Synopsis A super soldier from future Earth, after a mission gone wrong, is betrayed and hunted by the people he once fought for. However, through a freak twist of events involving a stolen classified portal and some odd serums, he ends up getting dragged along by a psychopathic criminal through this portal, never to be seen again. Until he woke up to the sound of, crying. A super soldier is reincarnated as a child in another world, one full of new people, places, and opportunities. This time, he's dead set on living it in a brighter, happier way, thinking he's finally gotten a life away and safe from the earth and its dark, manipulative hands. However unfortunately, destiny has other plans in store. Chapter 1, How Could I Have Known? The Year 2090 Black Facility 47 The subjects experienced lethal hemorrhaging in the brain, and those that didn't couldn't handle the increased neural activity leading to several psychological problems including psychopathy, retardation, induced autism, and... So what you're telling me, is that it failed again? Yes sir. Sigh. The head director sighed after receiving the report from one of his officers. He then stood up and walked to a window where he could oversee a few dozen capsules containing adult males. All of them were either sleeping or undergoing surgical operations. This was Black Facility 47. It was a top-secret base whose purpose was to carry out the Super Soldier program. This program was supposed to create and engineer enhanced soldiers that surpassed human limits and worked alongside machines, creating the perfect human weapon. This consisted of extreme training, genetic engineering, and cybernetic enhancement. However, despite having the program ongoing for nearly five years, the results were dismal. Hundreds died under the experiments and tests, and those that didn't were almost always hurt or disabled in some way. Black Facility 47 was, in fact, one of the few remaining facilities that still ran the program. There used to be 50, but when information leaked about the projects to the public and soldiers started mysteriously dying or disappearing, many facilities were shut down. Only the more successful ones, like Facility 47, stayed operational. But that success was starting to disappear, and the looming threat of shutting down was nigh. If he wasn't careful, the head director might also disappear along with the facility's shutdown, something which had happened to other directors for the sake of keeping information under wraps. This was a dangerous job to be in, but risk came with reward, and if he could find a way to succeed, he would enjoy walking one of the highest paths in life along with the elites. This dilemma made the director anxious, desperate, and scared but also hopeful. He never lost sight of gaining status, and by now, he was willing to do anything to achieve his goal. That fire was starting to grow dim though. It had been a long time since he had heard good news. Fortunately though, today was one of those rare days. We were able to find something though, sir. H.M.? What is it? The director turned his head back to the officer giving the report. This officer was one of his most trusted aides, and he would never give false hope. We think we might have narrowed down the best candidates. You see, we've consistently had better results with younger subjects, especially those at least under the age of 24. There was recently a recruit that I pulled who was age 16, and he dash. What? You pulled a minor as a subject? Suddenly, the director flew into a rage. Doing something like that was a huge violation of protocol. Just the fact that this officer went over his head to do something so risky almost made him pull his gun and shoot the man. His trust in this officer though made him hesitate, and that gave the officer the chance to hastily explain himself. Please let me explain, sir. Yes, the recruit was age 16, but he was an orphan from a school in the slums. There's nobody who had any connection to him and I left no trace of his kidnapping. Besides that though, this subject showed the best results yet. Sir, he was able to get through all the preliminary trials without injury. We were even able to move on to phase 3 before he showed signs of rejection to the treatment. The director stayed silent, and eventually removed his hand from his holster. The officer sighed and continued. Sir, I think we've found the answer. Younger subjects. Their adaptability far outstrips older soldiers, both psychologically and physiologically. 
they're the key to creating super soldiers. If it's with them, it can be done. Do you know what will happen if word of this leaks? Yes, sir. But if we don't succeed at all, if we don't take the risk, then we won't have any hope. Sir, I've done the tests. If we can get young subjects, around the age of six, then we'll be able to utilize their adaptability and raise them into super soldiers. It might take time, but if we doctor the documents to show the success of the young subjects, we can buy time. All of this assumes we succeed. Nothing is a guarantee, sir. However, if you give me the green light, I'll do everything myself. Nothing will leak. Please trust me, sir. The officer pleaded with the director. It wasn't just the director's life that was on the one. His was too, as was his family's. He was even more desperate than the director. The director paced around the room hearing his officer. This was exceptionally risky, but the officer was right. They needed to succeed. Failure wasn't an option. If this risk had a chance of success, then he needed to take it. As for the morality, the director had already gone beyond that. The things he carried out in this program crushed that sense years ago. It was all business now. Besides, his superiors only cared about results. If anything, from the things he knew about, they were more demented than him. After taking a second to ponder, he made his decision. All right. You do what you need to do. I'm giving you full authority. However, if I find that anything leaks out. That won't happen, sir. I've never failed you before. Then go. Start as soon as possible. Understood. Saluting, the officer hastily left the room. The director also plopped down in his chair, both uneasiness and hope flickering through his eyes. The year 2115, 25 years later. Mr. President. We have an emergency. In a secure room inside a towering skyscraper, the president and several other officials sat at a conference table. This meeting had been called within the last ten minutes in response to a sudden event. Let me hear it. There's been an attack recently on one of our facilities. It's the council. Of course it is. What did they hit? The president sighed tiredly. This was the name of the largest criminal syndicate in the world, and they were the bane of governments across the globe. This wasn't the first time they've come up, and lately, they had been attacking various facilities around the continent. They hit Black Facility 108. 108, which one is that? It's the facility running Project Wonderland, sir. What? Suddenly, the president snapped to attention. Project Wonderland was one of their most classified projects, and it was also one of the most heavily guarded. To think that place got raided. Even if it was by the council, it was an impossible task to pull off. How long ago was it raided? The last transmission we received was two hours ago, but we've been able to track them down to where they took the stolen project tech. So you have their location? Is it accurate? Yes, sir. We have a strike team ready to deploy. We're sending an SS Team Alpha, but we need your signature before he can deploy. Very well. Hearing that name, the president went quiet for a second before nodding. To send in that team meant that the situation really was dire, but that's exactly why he had to go. He was then handed the papers, and once they were signed, one of the generals sent a transmission to an unknown location. The green light on the raid to retake their tech was given. Meanwhile, 20 miles away from the location that the criminal syndicate was holding the tech, SS Team Alpha was lying in wait inside a small safe house, around which was a bustling city with tall buildings and neon signs. This team consisted of a single person. It was a boy, no more than 18 years of age. He was a bit over six foot tall, had brown hair, hazel eyes, and pale skin. He looked just like an ordinary guy who would be going into college soon. This boy was sitting on a couch inside the safe house reading a book that looked more like a manuscript, wearing sweats and a hoodie that covered his body. The cover of the book said Beyond Good and Evil, and the boy was reading it relaxedly. What's with you and always reading those books, huh? Suddenly, a voice came from another room. 
A man came walking in. He had a long brown beard and looked like some kind of lumberjack, speaking in a rough voice. His clothes were in shambles with a few stains. The boy looked away from his book and toward the lumberjack who was taking a swig from a big bottle of hooch, likely the source of the stains. Maybe you should read this book sometime. Friedrich Nietzsche is one of the most brilliant men to ever live. His books could teach you a thing or two about leading life. You think I need advice from a kid like you? Besides, those books are banned nowadays, especially to you. How'd you get your hands on one? It's called the internet and a printer. Plus a little help from a certain level of security clearance. Saying that, the boy held up a card. It was metal, and seeing it, the lumberjack's eyes went wide. Since when did you steal my card? I've had it for a week actually. Why you? Next time be more careful when you decide to pass out drunk. And you should really start keeping track of your stuff. Even knowing you, I'm surprised you haven't noticed it was gone. Shut up, brat. Give me that. Snatching the card back, the lumberjack huffed and took another swig. The boy smirked and went back to reading the book. After calming down and finishing his drink, the man spoke again. By the way, they gave the green light. You're due to start in thirty. Oh, all right. You need to be careful this time. I know you've gone up against them before, but the stuff they took is some dark shit. There's definitely a trap in place. But whatever do you mean? According to the intelligence report, they only stole a few medicine vials and a giant magnet. The boy chuckled deviously as he picked up the briefing. On it described the stolen items that were supposedly some medicine vials and a small particle cyclotron, but those were obviously just covers for what they really were. Don't play stupid, brat. That's the kind of information people kill themselves over. To have stolen that stuff means there's big shit going down, so screw your head on straight. All right, all right, don't get your panties in a twist. Not my first rodeo. Excuse me? You better shut that trap otherwise I'll make you wear actual panties on this operation, you pussy. Hoo-hoo, I apologize for my language, sir. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a mission to prepare for. Chuckling, the boy saluted the fuming lumberjack and disappeared into a back room. Seeing him go, the man just sighed and took out a cigar, lighting it and puffing out some smoke. Damn super soldiers always think they can talk smack. I've been his superior for over a decade. Don't I deserve a little respect? Hmph. A few minutes later, the boy came walking out. He was now dressed in metallic armor that looked like a nano suit. That suit held a pistol on each hip, a knife on the leg and arm, and a rifle on his back. There were also magazines around his torso held magnetically. He carried his helmet in one of his hands. SS008 reporting for duty. The boy, otherwise known as SS008, stood and saluted the lumberjack who was lazing around on the couch, smoking a cigar. Despite the formal presentation, the man just scoffed. Don't act like you suddenly care about procedure. You've got one job, kill everyone and take what we need. I know you're already prepared, so get out of here and see if you don't bust your tiny balls. Sir, I do not understand. Huh? The lumberjack squinted his eyes at the smiling boy. My balls are fat and large. How could they possibly dash? Shut up and fuck off. He he he. Laughing mischievously, the boy dodged the full bottle of alcohol that was thrown at him and ran out of the building. The lumberjack was left smoking from both the mouth and head in annoyance. However, as he ran out, the lumberjack caught a glimpse of a tattoo on the boy's neck. This tattoo was of a black cat, and seeing the tattoo it felt like he was being stared down by a predator. He suddenly sighed, and his anger subsided. He felt pity, though it was unknown if it was for the boy or for the enemies. Outside the city was rural, barren land. The boy, now operating under the tag SS008, trudged across some cold desert dirt and brush. Above him was the night sky, and behind him was the city that shone with bright lights, tall glass skyscrapers, and neon holograms. For a long minute, the boy stared back at the city from under a metal, featureless helmet, 
many thoughts flying through his head. The cold wind blew past him, and just as it started to calm, the boy took out his rifle and turned away from the city. He looked off into the distance. He was only two miles away from the target. The place that the council was holding the stolen goods was an abandoned 80-year-old factory. It was well guarded with the remnants of the forces that had survived the initial raid. However, it was no less dangerous, because SS-008 would now have to infiltrate and steal something from this fortress. SS-008 continued walking toward that very factory with just his armor and weapons. Soon, the time for him to start had come. All around the factory were enemies and spotlights. They stood up on rooftops, patrolled around the facility with jeeps, and scanned the area with turrets. There were also robots that constantly watched the surroundings. Hmm. Suddenly, one of the soldiers at the factory who was posted up on a rooftop spotted something in the dark. It was a figure the size of a man, and it stood on the edge of one of the spotlights eerily. Looking through his sniper scope, he got a closer look. When he did though, chills ran down his spine. It's him. H. Hey. It's him. Who? Where? Down there. At the spotlight. The man pointed a laser at where the figure was, and one of the men operating the spotlights moved it to shine on that position. However, there was nothing there. Despite that though, the people who looked at the area also felt their necks tingle. Nobody there would be falsely alarmed, and there was only one person they knew of who could suddenly disappear like how they thought just happened. I it's him, sound the ala dash. Splat. As the man was trying to shout, a new hole was suddenly opened up in his head. Blood splattered in the air, and his body collapsed to the ground. The helmet he was wearing did nothing to protect him. Many of the men around the factory heard this, and all of them started to call in on their communication channels. Before they could though, bullets started entering everyone's brains. Splat, 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 splat. In only seconds, every single person patrolling or scanning outside the factory had a new bloody hole in their heads. The spotlight stopped moving, the jeeps patrolling veered off and crashed, and even the robots and turrets that were scanning around mysteriously shut down. The surroundings went dead silent. SS-008, who was now on one of the roofs of the factory, looked at all his kills with apathetic eyes. He then looked down. Within the factory, he couldn't detect any signs of life. It was odd, and definitely a red flag. But that meant nothing to him, and after dropping a sticky explosive on the roof he was standing on, it exploded, and he jumped into the hole. Tap. Landing on the ground with a light foot, he scanned around with his rifle raised. He found nothing except for dead machines, cold steel, and an eerily quiet breeze. But suddenly. Take him down. A feminine voice echoed through the factory. With it, SS-008 felt a threat to his life for the first time in a long time, and he dashed to the side. PSH. Or, at least he tried. Before he could move, long skinny spears were shot at him with the speed of a bullet. There were five, and each one was aimed toward his limbs and torso, intending to pin him down. But he was able to slightly dodge fast enough. When they arrived, only one impaled him in his right leg. Without hesitation, he skillfully took out a knife and slashed at the spear. Despite being metal, it was cut like butter, and he continued to move from his position as a sitting duck after taking the spear out of his leg. But that wasn't the end of it. From the dark pits of the factory, distortions started to make their way out and toward him. SS-008 recognized this as a cloaking device, and he shot at all movement that he could barely detect. Bang! 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 Gunshots rang and echoed out against the metal walls, and several distortions collapsed, revealing bodies cloaked in black. Some got past though, and he was quickly put into close combat. Grabbing a pistol and a knife, he proceeded to fight off these distortions. They all attempted to stab him with swords or knives or shoot him with guns, but with his skillful movement and uncanny accuracy, he was able to avoid most attacks and kill more distortions. The rest that he didn't doge were blocked by his state-of-the-art armor. Come on! 
we were prepared for this, and he's only one person. Take him down. The woman's voice echoed out once more like an announcer, and with it, even more distortions appeared and went on to attack SS-008. More spears also started to be fired. However, after hearing and analyzing the voice with the onboard systems of his suit, SS-008 was able to identify the origin. There. He looked toward a certain area of the factory. There, he could barely pick up electromagnetic flickers in the atmosphere. Raising his gun, he fired there. Bang! Zap! Hitting something, the bullet was stopped, but the invisibility cloak was removed. It revealed a small office-like building. Smiling under his mask, SS-008 killed the distortions around him, dodged the oncoming spears, and charged the building. His suit heated up as power gathered, and he rammed the wall like a bull. Boom! The wall was blown away, and inside was revealed a bright room. In this room, SS-008 quickly spotted four things. The first was a giant magnet ring the size of a person against one wall. The second was a table with a suitcase on it containing three vials. The third was a wall of nine high-powered anti-material rifles stacked in a three-by-three three square pointed straight at him. The fourth was a woman who stood behind the rifles. Bye-bye. Click. Boom. After smiling in victory, the woman pressed a button, and the rifles fired. Nine huge bullets were sent point-blank towards him at supersonic speeds. He couldn't dodge. In that instant, SS-008 had several questions run through his head. Who the hell lines up guns like that? Why was she prepared for such a specific scenario? This is just ridiculous. Splat. The bullets tore through him and huge bloody holes were created on his body. He was sent flying back and collapsed on the floor with a gory sound. Ha ha ha. Another win. And this time, I took out the most notorious super soldier. Man, you've really caused me problems, you know? The woman laughed manically and walked out from behind the giant guns, approaching the body of SS-008. She was a curvy woman dressed in a black bodysuit. Her black hair and defined face looked innocent as she moved next to and peered over SS-008's bleeding body. Hmm, I've never seen your face. You always have that helmet on when you obliterate my little labs and hideouts. Now, it's time to see my bane. My evil prince who foils all my plans. Reaching down with a wide smile, the woman grabbed the head and took off the helmet. Underneath was a smirking face. Oh. You're so handsome. And alive. She staggered back in surprise, but before the distortions around them could act to finish off SS-008, he shot up and grabbed the woman, holding her hostage. Nobody move. SS-008 wrapped up the woman and placed a pistol against her head. He then quickly backed toward the building with the items, making sure they couldn't try anything. Ah. Don't kill me. Listen to him, you fools. Put those weapons down. Don't you know who he is? The woman shouted hysterically and the distortions gradually laid down their weapons. Seeing how much of a coward the girl was, SS-008 sighed in relief, though he didn't show it on his face. He held the woman against his body, pistol pointed right at her temple. During this, nanites within his body moved through his limbs and sealed the holes created by the bullets. These nanites in the suit were the only reasons he could keep moving, though it caused him much pain. In only a matter of seconds, the bleeding stopped, and the suit began to inject drugs into him that would allow him to maintain combat effectiveness. However, the next moment, the woman smiled wickedly and expertly shot her hand toward a wound on his leg. And it was a syringe, and before SS-008 could react, it poked into him. PSH. Hey! Don't make me shoot you! Crack! Ag! After grabbing the girl's hand and smacking away the syringe, he twisted her wrist, causing her to cry out in pain. Unfortunately, the syringe completely injected the stuff into him. While he didn't know what it was, he couldn't let his hostage go and kept his cool. He quickly sent out a transmission using his mind. 
Headquarters, this is SS-008. Operation has been compromised. Requesting immediate support. Packages have been identified on site and I'm currently holding a hostage. Enemies are still present and I've been injected with an unknown substance, possibly poison. Awaiting your arrival. With that, he stopped communicating. He continued to remain in a standoff with the distortions while holding the woman hostage. Surprisingly, she became calm despite the broken wrist. Can you feel it? After a while, the woman spoke. SS-008 didn't respond, but glanced at her in curiosity. The injection. It's a beautiful thing, the substance that was in there. Did they tell you what it was? What was it? And what's the antidote? Hoo, it's not poison. No, it's something far greater. It's the gateway. The hell are you talking about? What's it going to do to me? If it does anything, I'm going to kill you, so you better think carefully. SS-008 tightened his grip on her neck and pressed the gun harder into her temple. She just smiled though as if she liked it. Hoo, don't worry. I've just given you a wonderful gift. It has effects, but they're not ones you want to avoid. He he he. Though, you might want to be cautious. The people behind you, they might have things to say about this. Be careful. Your value now exceeds imagination. Just shut up. Your life will be over soon anyway. Oh, I don't think so. If anything, it's just starting to begin. Hey! What are, you? The woman grabbed the arms that were pinning her back and removed them. SS-008 was about to strengthen his grip, but bafflingly, he couldn't exert any strength, like he was paralyzed. He fell to the floor, and the woman smiled sweetly as she looked down at his incapacitated body and incredulous face. I'll be seeing you later. You know. Now that I look at you closer, you really are very handsome. Maybe if we have time. We'll have to play around at my super secret hideout. You know, before we have to leave forever. Oh. This is just so romantic. The poor little soldier and the beautiful princess tied by fate. He he he. Anyway, I should get going. I have to prepare for the big finale. Here's a parting gift. A token of my undying sincerity. Bending down, the woman sweetly pinched SS-008's nose and gave him a kiss on the cheek. He could only stare at her, paralyzed by both the mysterious substance and by her insane mannerisms. The woman then skipped off out of the factory like a little girl. SS-008 started losing consciousness not long after, and the world soon went black. Chapter 2 – That Everything Would Be Flipped Upside Down Hey! Get up, you brat! Smack. There he is. After getting a slap to the face, SS-008 opened his eyes. The first thing he saw was the roof of the factory where he went unconscious. The second was the face of the lumberjack who was puffing smoke into his face. Don't you know smoking is bad for you? Don't you know that you should keep that shit-eating trap of yours shut? Get the hell up. Heh. Chuckling, SS-008 went and stood up. However, as he got to his feet, he staggered unsteadily, prompting the lumberjack to catch him. Whoa! What's going on? You drinking now? It's the stuff they injected me with. I guess it's not totally out of my system yet. Wait, what happened after I lost consciousness? SS-008 asked as he steadied himself against the lumberjack. Not long after you sent the transmission, we caught them hauling away the packages. We weren't able to respond with a large enough force, and they got away. Well that's going to look bad. How many times have I failed? I think this is the fourth time. They were prepared. As I said, this was a trap, and you couldn't adapt. Honestly, I'm baffled that they just left you alive. Anyway, you'll be getting sent back to the program after this to undergo more training so you can scrape off that rust. Until then, kiss the outside world goodbye. That won't be happening, Sergeant. Suddenly, a voice came from behind the lumberjack who was carrying away SS-008. 
they turned and saw two men in suits approaching them with an entourage of soldiers. SS-008 scanned the soldiers and noticed that they were super soldiers like him from another team. Mr. President, sir. The lumberjack saluted the president, as did SS-008, albeit with difficulty. He just nodded to them. At ease. Except for you, SS-008. Awaiting your orders, sir. I have a question for you, SS-008. In your transmission, you said you were injected with a substance. Is that correct? Yes, sir. While I was holding a woman hostage, she injected one of my open wounds with an unknown substance. I see. Did the syringe look anything like this? The president's aide took out a briefcase and opened it, revealing a syringe inside a slot. There were also two other slots that were empty that should be occupied by syringes. SS-008 looked at it and recognized it. The syringe was the one the woman injected him with, and the briefcase was one of the items he was supposed to retrieve, or at least the items in it were. It was clear the woman got away with them. Yes, sir. That syringe is the one I was injected with. So indeed it was. Sir, I don't know what that substance was, but I can still function. Once I recover, I can go back out with a team and operate as you need me. SS-008 saluted with the utmost respect. This was the president, and he had been taking direct orders from him for almost all his life. However, after a bit of pondering, the president looked at him with odd eyes. SS-008 inwardly frowned at those eyes and he could immediately tell that something was wrong. He then remembered the words of the woman, and his guard increased. Sergeant. Sir. Step away from SS-008. Sir. That's an order, Sergeant. With an odd look, the lumberjack removed SS-008's arm from around his shoulder and stepped back, leaving him to falter with no support. SS-008 kept himself somewhat upright though using his remaining strength that was slowly recovering. Super Soldier Designation Number 008 From this moment forwards, you are to be decommissioned and inserted into high-security prison for the violation of classification protocols. Sir, violation? SS Team Beta, secure this prisoner and escort him away. Yes, sir. W-8 how did I violate protocol? SS-008 Are you resisting the orders of the president? Are you committing treason? The man next to the president yelled at SS-008, and the beta team consisting of eight soldiers took out electrical rods, clearly threatening him. Stunned, SS-008 felt his adrenaline kick in, and he saluted the president once more. No, sir. I am questioning the reason for the violation. I am unaware of what I did, Rodash. You don't need to know what you did wrong, and you have no right to question my orders. SS-008, you will either comply and be peacefully escorted, or you will be forcefully deactivated and dragged to the scrapper. Sir Dash. SS Team Beta, apprehend the prisoner. This is a direct order. Sir Ack. Right as he was about to attempt to talk to the president again, the other super soldiers came over to him and whacked him with their electric batons. They had a slightly paralyzing effect that not only targeted the body but his cybernetics. It was clear that the team came prepared to apprehend him specifically. Seeing all this, SS-008 felt something in his mind snap. His body then started to strengthen as he mustered up all the concentration and energy he could. Get off of me! Boom! He threw a punch toward one of the super soldiers, sending him flying and planting him in a wall. Everyone looked at SS-008 with surprised faces, shocked at both his strength and the fact that he was defying orders. Adrenaline pushing his weakness away, SS-008 stood up and fended off the other seven soldiers while enduring the electric shocks that consistently stunned him. I didn't do anything wrong. Crack! I was just following orders. Bang! That crazy bitch just injected me with something. Why am I being decommissioned? Boom! Going between the soldiers attacking him, SS-008 broke bones, slammed their armor into the floor, and punted them across the factory. 
all the other personnel in the vicinity backed away, including the president who felt his heart pounding out of his chest in nervousness and fear. Utilizing all his energy, SS-008 managed to fend off the soldiers and put distance between them. Unfortunately, he was quickly surrounded by other soldiers who pointed high-powered weapons at him. Now, there really wasn't anything he could do, and he slumped to the floor as the last of his strength faded. I just... I didn't do anything wrong. Muttering to himself, SS-008 looked to the lumberjack who was standing near the president. Both of them stared at each other, and SS-008 didn't even look away as people carefully approached him and locked up his arms. A restriction device was put over his head that covered his chest like a breastplate. The device then took control of the cybernetics in his body, deactivating them as well as the nanosuit which was quickly stripped off. He suddenly felt profoundly weak, even more than before. Get him out of here. The president spoke after recovering, and the other super-soldiers who weren't incapacitated came over and hoisted him up, dragging him out of the factory. He was too weak to even stand. Holy shit. It's him. Why is he locked down? How the hell did they even pull that off? SS-008 was taken all the way to a skyscraper within the city that was the headquarters for government operations. It was one of the tallest buildings there was and as he was being escorted to an unknown place, the hundreds of people they passed all stared at him, shocked. He was bloodied, his limbs locked up with high-tech restraints, and a mean look was plastered on his face, sending chills down the spines of everyone who saw. By this time, he was able to stand and walk himself, and even the guards escorting him didn't lay a hand on him unless absolutely necessary. It was almost like they were transporting a government official rather than a prisoner with how fearful and respectful they were. As they came down a long corridor on one of the upper floors of the tower though, the group stopped. A man stood in front of them, and he stared at SS-008 with an angry look on his face. It was the lumberjack. You little piece of shit. Have I not trained you properly? Sir, you can't approach Dash. Get the fuck out of my way. I've dealt with this dog for over a decade. Are you saying you can handle him better than me? Besides, I've got a few things to say. Pushing aside the guard, the lumberjack approached SS-008. They looked into each other's eyes again, but this time, there was clear hostility between both. Don't look at me like that, you lowlife. Bam! The lumberjack threw a solid punch at his face, causing blood to fly out. SS-008 was sent to the floor, still a bit weak from the deactivation. Is that it? Not gonna bark like you did earlier? Fuck. It's like all my training was for this. Why the hell did I even bother with you back then, huh? Thud. Ack. The lumberjack sent a kick this time, sending his steel toe right into his gut. All the wind was knocked out of SS-008, and he was left barely gasping for breath. Are you really a super soldier? Shit, I might just take you for a normal recruit at this rate. You might as well have just been left in the backwater slum scraping together moldy bread as a child. Maybe when you keeled over from the freezing cold, you could have at least been worth something to the dogs that ate you. Crack. Ah. SS-008 yelled out in pain as the lumberjack circled around him and kicked him right in his spine, causing it to let out a nasty sound. Mph. You really are just a piece of shit. Don't resist as they go and scrap you for parts. It'll remove you from this world quicker. Pooh. Spitting on his face, the lumberjack turned and walked away. Seeing he was done, the soldiers who were escorting SS-008 went and picked him up again, continuing to drag him. Looking to the back of the lumberjack who turned the corner into a certain hallway, SS-008 ever so slightly smirked through the pain. He could see data streaming through his retina. Rebooting. Recalibrating cybernetics. Scanning body. Warning. SS-008 is in critical condition. Administering applicable doses of medical serum. Activating nanobot repair systems. Warning. Emergency state detected. Activating overdrive. Administering adrenaline serum. 
assembling final stand weapon system. With those notifications in his vision, his cybernetics started running in overdrive, and his strength started to return. Certain devices in his body also started to move in his abdomen. On the outside though, nothing appeared to be happening as SS-008 continued to be dragged by the guards. This went on for several more minutes until finally, SS-008 saw the notifications he was waiting for. Medical serum administered. Nerve connections at 94%. Skeletal repair progress, 87%. Muscle systems repair progress, 66%. Current bodily state, temporarily combat capable. Medical attention required. Final stand weapon system constructed. Eject when ready. Seeing that, SS-008 smiled. Then, utilizing the systems in his body, he targeted the restraints and unlocked them. Click! As if that sound was death's bell, all the guards froze up in terror. Before they could even react, SS-008 acted. Slice! Splat! With a swing of his arm, all four guards around him were decapitated. Their armor didn't do anything to protect them. SS-008 stood up and straightened his back as four heads and four bodies collapsed to the floor. He spun a long and thick knife in his hand that was a borderline short sword. It had been ejected from his abdomen, and it was the weapon system that was present within every super soldier as a final line of defense. It wasn't just a knife though. After giving it a command, the knife reassembled itself into a pistol with a single magazine of bullets loaded into it. SS-008 glanced at the guards. None of them had weapons except for electric batons, a failsafe so as to ensure he couldn't get a weapon easily should he manage to go free. So since he couldn't get anything from them, not even the armor which had locks on them, he removed the restraints, turned, and ran back the way he came. Retracing his steps, he ran past many people who were once again startled by his appearance. He didn't bother with them though and quickly found the hallway that the lumberjack went down. Turning the corner, he ran through and found an open door. Nobody was around, and SS-008 recognized this as the lumberjack's office. Get in here, dumbass. You made me wait long enough. SS-008 smiled as he walked into the room. When he did, he could see the lumberjack who was kicked back on a chair. In the office was a standard desk, some bookshelves, and a couch with a coffee table. One thing was new though, and that was the vast assortment of weapons strewn across the floor. You had me scared for a little while. That's the only time I'm ever gonna save your sorry ass, so don't get used to it. Now, you've got a job to do. Job? SS-008 tilted his head as the lumberjack kicked his feet up on his desk, letting out a long plume of smoke from his mouth that was holding a fancy cigar. Your new job is to escape this godforsaken place. Your assets are anything in this room, except for my chair and my cigar. Escape, ha? Huh? What about you? They'll have your head since you helped me. If I gave a shit I would have left you to be scrapped. Now choose your damn weapons. You'll have to go without a nano suit, and I don't have any medical supplies, but oh well. I'm sure your scrawny ass can handle a little bit of discomfort. Sergeant. My name is Gray. The lumberjack, Gray, gave his name. SS008's eyes went wide. He had never known the guy's name and only ever called him Sergeant since he was a child. Now get your shit and get on out of here. Sunrise is in three hours, so you better be far away from here before then. Where are you going? I'm gonna take care of some business. All I can say is, if you get out of here fast enough, you won't need to worry about these people chasing your tail for a long while. Why can't you just leave with me? Because I don't really feel like it. Now get out of here. Take it as one last order from your damn superior. Have I earned enough of your respect for you to obey me this once? Yes, sir. Good. Now hurry up. Troops are piling up the building as we speak. Yes, sir. Feeling a tearing inside his chest that he's never felt before, SS-008 went over to one of the walls and grabbed some pistols and a rifle along with some ammo and even grenades. 
Then, after saluting Gray who was still casually resting on his chair smoking a cigar, he left the room. Boom! Bang! 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 Shatter! Gunshots and explosions rang out on one of the floors of the skyscraper, blowing holes in the glass and attracting attention from civilians below on the streets. SS-008 was fighting his way down through the floors. At first, he was on floor 63, but he had made his way down to floor 32. Sometimes he jumped outside the skyscraper and descended floors through the outside, sometimes he descended stairwells, sometimes he blew a hole in the floor, and he even took an elevator down a few floors once. No amount of obstacles could stop him. At this point though, he was getting to his objective. He had wreaked anarchy across all the floors where hundreds of soldiers and security guards constantly made trouble for him. But he wasn't planning on descending to the ground floor. No, he was almost right where he wanted to be. Upon reaching floor 30, he looked out the window after killing off several guards. Across a large gap he could see another building, and he was planning to go to it. Last grenade. Do your work. Taking a grenade out of his pocket, he pressed a button and activated it. He then threw it to the glass and took cover. Boom! With an explosion, the entire side of the building was blown out, creating a ledge. SS-008 walked out from behind cover and looked across the way toward the other building. What is it? A bank? Oh well. Shrugging, he created some distance between him and the ledge. Then without hesitation, he broke out in a full sprint and activated his legs to their fullest, launching himself out of the building. Whoosh! The wind blew against him as he sailed through the air over 300 feet above the ground. The lights of the city illuminated his vision, and he looked down to see streets full of cars and spectators. For a moment, he wondered if anybody was able to snap a picture of him. He kept his focus on the building though, which was fast approaching. After getting close, he swung forward his fist with all his might, sending it into the side of the stone building. Bang! The wall crumbled under his fist, and his entire forearm sank into the stone, holding him up. He looked back toward the skyscraper he jumped from and could see soldiers standing at the ledge he jumped from. Humph! Snorting, SS-008 grabbed the new holding and tore his arm out. He then took out his knife that was ejected from his body and inserted it into the wall, letting himself glide down the stone. Once at the bottom, he quickly evaded the soldiers who were flooding out of the skyscraper after him, and using the crowd to his advantage, he managed to disappear from everyone's sights. Sergeant Gray! What the hell is going on? The president, who was absolutely livid, entered Gray's office with another escort of soldiers. After the whole fiasco with SS-008, he came over to his office as he received an extremely urgent message. The president was pissed and wanted to see what exactly Gray had that could help their situation. Contrary to the urgency in his message though, Gray was sitting in his office chair relaxedly. He had a cigar in his mouth and held a picture frame, on it was himself and a woman. None of the guns or any signs that SS-008 entered were present in his office. Gray. Explain yourself right now. Mr. President, I'm going to keep things to the point. Please do. My wife died before we could have kids, and I volunteered for the super soldier program in hopes of raising a man by my own hand. It was one of my lifelong dreams. What the hell are you talking about? You, did you let SS-008 escape? And after all these years, I was finally able to raise a kid into a pretty decent person. He was forged into a weapon, but he still kept his heart. You though. You took that away from me. SS-008? What, was he some kind of child to you? He was a soldier. Yes he was, but he was also my son. At least, that's how I raised him. So you were the one to let him go. Sergeant Gray, what you just did makes you a traitor to the state. Men, apprehend and prepare this man for execution. This scum will pay for his crimes. Humph, in your dreams, you demented piece of shit. Gray chuckled and flexed his hand. Suddenly, beeping sounds came from all throughout the room, and the president's eyes widened. You son of a dash. Asterisk boom. 
Asterisk. An explosion annihilated everything, going so far as to destroy the entire 63rd floor of the skyscraper. Flames spewed out from all the glass and into the outside world, separating the 100-story building in two. Boom! Suddenly, SS-008, who was walking off out of the city, heard an explosion in the distance. He turned around to look back at the city and could see the skyscraper and the flames billowing out of it. Then, the top half of the building tipped over and fell. Something like this was something you'd see in a large-scale terrorist attack. He felt tremendous pain seeing that though. The one man he was friends with. The one man who had shown him the concept of a father. Gray. He felt the tearing in his chest again. The emotional pain physically hurt him, and for a long while, he stood there, enduring. After some time though, he was interrupted. It was the dark of night, and he was out in the barren areas outside the city. But out of nowhere, he could sense some shadowy figures approach him. SS-008. We've been waiting. The madam wishes to see you. Chapter 3, and I would be reborn. Who the hell are you guys? SS-008 looked around with a menacing gaze, clearly not in a good mood. There were sixteen shadowy figures that revealed themselves as women. One of them had spoken to him. The woman was beautiful and curvy, and along with the skin-tight bodysuit, she looked like some kind of sexy ninja. All of the women around him were like that. SS-008 just looked at her with frigid coldness though, as if she was some kind of joke. The woman answered him with a neutral gaze. The madam who you took hostage earlier. She wishes to see you. That crazy bitch. Tell her that she can shove those syringes she stole up her ass. I want nothing to do with her. Unfortunately we can't allow that. You must come with us. The woman's eye twitched at the insult to her madam, but she quelled her rising anger. She couldn't fail her mission to retrieve this super soldier, no matter what she felt. Hearing her insistence, SS-008 snarled. I'd like to see you make me. Bang! Raising his gun, he went on to fire at the woman. Mysteriously though, she disappeared when the bullet hit. The next moment, all the other women moved and attacked. Some took out items like spears and others took out guns. SS-008 was put under fire, but not even getting hit by a bullet would stop him. Facing the women, he shot at each one while moving to dodge. As he moved though, the weakness in his body started to overtake him. He had exerted himself and gotten more wounds while fighting in the skyscraper, and his body had already reached its limit. He was fighting on sheer will now, and to put up a fight against a bunch of specialists was asking a lot of him. He didn't go down with nothing though. Only after a whole minute of shooting and killing nine of the women did he start to go down. A stun bullet was the last thing to hit him, and it caused him to give out. Ack! With a pained shout, SS-008 couldn't help it as he fell to his knees and then to the floor, getting a face full of cold dirt. With him incapacitated, the original woman walked over to him as his consciousness faded. You damn bastard. If the madam didn't request for you, I would have gutted you like a pig. Ha! Ah. Bringing back her foot, the woman let out a venomous shout and kicked him across the face, knocking him out. Hello hey! Hey! Wake up! Ha! Ah. There he is! I knew you wouldn't die so easily. I mean, how could you with your reputation? SS-008 slowly woke up to a familiar voice. As his eyes opened and vision focused, he found that a woman was standing over him, her face directly in front of his. Good morning, sleepyhead. Ack! You! What? What's going on? As SS-008 was going to push the woman away, he found that all his limbs were tied down. As he looked around, he found that he was on some kind of stretcher bed within a dark room. He, I saved your life. Well, you would have survived anyway, but I definitely helped. Why am I tied down? Well, I can't have you running amok, now can I? It won't be for long though. After all, we have things to do, and not a lot of time to do it in. Rumble. After she spoke, the ground trembled like an earthquake. 
The woman looked up toward the ceiling. Looks like they've got in. What? Who? Your friends are here to destroy my super secret hideout. After the president was killed, they all went crazy and launched attacks jointly with the neighboring governments and defense agencies. Several of my bases have been destroyed, and now they're coming after me. They probably think I was behind the assassination. This place is under siege? You? Who the hell are you? SS008 spoke as he scanned the woman. When she was his hostage, she didn't seem all that important and he didn't really think about who she might be. But now she was being attacked by several military groups. She definitely wasn't someone small. You're saying you don't know me? Well, since you were kept so in the dark, I guess that's normal. Then allow me to introduce myself. I have three names. The first is the name I gave myself, Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom. The second, is Super Soldier Designation 202, the tag I received from my program. And the third, is Head of the Council. When she finished, the woman grinned at SS008, whose eyes went wide. Head of the Council. You were a super soldier? Indeed I was. I was in the second generation. Unfortunately, my brain apparently couldn't handle Phase 3, and I was abandoned as a failed subject. They said I became too psychopathic and mentally unstable to continue with the program. I don't know what they were thinking though. I mean, just look at the empire I created. The woman spun around with her arms wide, gesturing to her super secret hideout and the council that she ran. SS008 stared at her, conflicted thoughts going through his mind. So that's who you were. You were the devil of class too. Devil? So they have a name for me there, huh? You created the largest criminal syndicate in the world. You've carried out dozens of large-scale terrorist attacks. I've been fighting against a failed super soldier all this time. Indeed you have. I must say, meeting one of my own is refreshing. So robust and pleasing to the eye. I'm sure we would have gotten along well despite the fact that we're all orphans. You know, find comfort in each other's arms and all. Don't touch me. He he he. The woman giggled like a little girl as she came over and played with his hair. He just looked at her like she was insane though. The head of the council. This was a person that governments around the world had been hunting for over a decade. They had the public believing that the head was some evil man who could genocide without batting an eye. But little did they know that the governments were the ones who created this monster. The super soldier program had plenty of failed subjects. Those that failed were often driven insane, became disabled, or were mentally impaired. This girl was one of the luckier ones, and she came out as a high-functioning failure. Unfortunately, a high-functioning psychopath wasn't someone you wanted out on the streets. Especially one who had a grudge against you. But based on everything she did, the criminal empire she built and the attacks she carried out, she proved herself to be one of the most intelligent people on the planet. She put the entire criminal underworld on a leash and turned it against the world establishments in such a short amount of time. Only an evil genius could do something like that. So naturally, SS008 was shocked. This was a monumental secret that would flip the world upside down if the public knew. To think the bane of the civilized world was created by the world leaders themselves. But you know, you're very impressive yourself, Super Soldier Designation 008. The woman smiled as she backed away from his bed and picked up some papers. Let's see. Top soldier in the program, enough to earn you a single-digit designation. You've been running black operations since you were 13. An orphan from the slums taken in when you were 6. Exceptional performance in adaptability and effective combat can take out entire military strongholds by yourself. Well, I think that's obvious considering what you just did. Is that my file? How did you get that? Using a little something called the internet and a printer. Hmm, you have dozens of cybernetic implants. Bone strengthening, artificial blood, a synthetic heart, compacted muscles, invisibility skin, electronic hacking systems. And you even have the neural interface. 
that was the part that messed me up. My brain couldn't adapt to the AI they tried to insert. SS008 was silent. The AI interfacing was indeed the part that failed most subjects. During phase 3, the last phase of the program, the brain was injected with a serum that made your brain more capable of interacting with electromagnetic waves. Then, they attached a neural device that could tap directly into your brain through those waves. On that device was an AI, and it would provide an onboard computer as well as increase neural activity permanently. It was advanced tech, but many subjects couldn't handle the interface. The neural acceleration could go so far as to fry people's brains, and it had a very low success rate. But for those that succeeded, they would be turned into super soldiers. You could even say that the previous phases were merely preparation for phase 3. Anyway, it looks like we both had plenty of success due to the program despite our totally divergent paths. Although you were basically disowned, you still earn one of the most fearsome reputations around the world. People call you the Grim Reaper itself. The Boogeyman, the Steel Demon, the Emissary of Darkness. He, they're horrible names, but I guess nobody cares about that when they're about to die. Oh. And there's also this. Saying that, the woman walked up to him and pulled the collar of his shirt down, exposing the tattoo on his neck. The Black Cat. A symbol of bad luck, and one that you never want to cross paths with. People in the Middle Ages used to kill black cats due to their association with the underworld. Black cats were also associated with witches. It's rather fitting since you, my friend, surely are the walking incarnation of bad luck. The woman smiled mysteriously, and SS008 couldn't respond. Was he the one who had bad luck, being brought into the super soldier program at a young age? Or were his enemies those unlucky victims? This was a dilemma that he had pondered a lot, and it was actually the reason he got this tattoo. Gray was the one who had given him the idea after saying something similar, so he decided to get it. When this woman stated that he was the incarnation of bad luck, he once again fell into that dilemma. His mood worsened thinking about it all. Rumble. The room shook again as the woman stared at him from a chair, her chin resting on her palm. SS008 couldn't tell what she was thinking, but after a while of silence, her mouth opened. I feel bad. You have feelings? Of course. Not many, but I still have them. Anyway, I feel sad since you lost your sergeant. He's the one who set off that explosion, right? Oh, I made you more sad. Well, I don't know if it'll make up for it, but I guess I should tell you about the serum you were injected with. Saying that, the woman stood up. Clap clap. With two claps, the surroundings suddenly lit up. SS008 looked around. They were in a large underground room. On one side of the room was the person-sized cyclotron, and in the middle of the room was a table with two syringes on it inside a container. The woman walked over to the syringes and looked at them. I told you before. These syringes hold a glorious substance. Tell me, do you believe in the concept of souls? Souls? I don't know. Well, you better believe it. Let me take you back though. Once upon a time, there was a group of scientists who managed to create a portal that could poke through dimensions. Unfortunately, whenever someone tried to enter the portal, they were rejected and killed. It was weird because while the people would be physically injured, the injuries were never fatal, yet they would still die a little while after being rejected. Why? Well, it turns out that the portal destroyed their souls. Or something like that. Anyway, those scientists then started to make a device or serum that could prevent one from dying and let them enter the portal. To do this, they needed something that protected the soul. Well, this serum is supposedly their first successful attempt, and I did everything I could to get my hands on it. I used practically every resource I had to even get the chance to take this stuff. I know it's hard to believe. I couldn't believe it either. But the world is advancing further than you know, and this stuff is no longer science fiction. As for the portal, the reason they want to enter it so bad is because they managed to prove that it led somewhere. Somewhere solid like a landmass. Somewhere with life signs. 
they actually found another world, hence the project's codename, Project Wonderland. The most classified project in the world. Of course, I couldn't just let those idiots have this. So I stole all their tech, the only three serums in existence, the portal, and almost all the data on the subject. This pissed them off to no end though, and that's why they sent you. Then, things went as you know it. Our lives were turned upside down in only a day. Pretty crazy, huh? So what do you plan to do? Rumble. The room rumbled as SS008 questioned. He was rather enlightened about things. He usually knew nothing about the operations he ran, so getting such classified information was nice. Only, he couldn't help but have a foreboding feeling. Sure enough, the woman revealed an unnatural smile. What do you mean? I'm planning to enter the portal. And you're coming with me. Hey scientist guy. Start up the portal. The woman shouted after dropping that bombshell on SS-008, prompting a man to enter the room and walk up to the portal. After pressing a few buttons, the portal activated, and massive amounts of energy congealed in the center of the portal, creating a swirling wall of purple plasma. Hey, you wanna see something cool? Watch this. Smiling widely, the woman grabbed the man who just booted up the portal and shoved him into it. Shocked, the man tried to fight back, but he was thrown off balance and fell straight towards the plasma. Surprisingly though, he wasn't burned or stopped. His body entered the portal, but only moments later, it came flying back out like it was spat out. Now, his body had horrible burns on the skin. Ugh. Ah. The man groaned and struggled for a short amount of time, but eventually, the life faded from his eyes. SS-008 watched, half curious and half mortified. The man really shouldn't have died since the injuries weren't lethal, yet he still did. See? Nobody has ever been able to survive entering the portal. That always happens. But now with the serums, we should be able to enter. Supposedly it isolates and strengthens your soul to allow it to survive the transportation. Or something like that. You've already got it in you, and now, I need it. The woman skipped over to the table next and picked up one of the syringes. She then stuck it in a vein, injecting everything at once and letting out a groan of pleasure. Ah. I promise I don't do drugs. Now, since we have one more, and I want to be extra sure, let's take both. Giggling to herself, she grabbed the second syringe and injected it just like the first without any regard for safety. SS-008 stared at her incredulously, his opinion of her being insane solidifying in his heart. Ha ha. I can already feel it flowing. I don't want to pass out like you though, so we should move quickly. Ha. Huh. No, there's no way. What? You've got the serum, so you should be fine. I'm the one who's more at risk here since I haven't acclimated yet. Now, are you ready to start a new life? You're crazy. That thing will kill us both. How does a serum protect you from that? Ha ha ha. I don't know. But hey, it's ride or die now, isn't it? After all, the enemies are going to break in any second now, and I've got a bomb that's going to blow this place to smithereens once we enter. Rumble. The room shook even harder as if affirming her statement. SS-008 knew that they were in a bad position, but he felt that he could fight his way out. He had done that in every other impossible situation. If he could just get out of the restraints, he could go out and face them. But this woman wouldn't let him go. She was insisting on dragging him into certain doom. If he was going to die, it was going to be on his terms. Damn it, you crazy bitch. I'm not dying yet. Let me go. Ouch. That's hurtful, you know. And you won't die. Just trust me. No. Let me out. Ha ha ha. Come on. You and me, isn't it romantic? Charging off into unknown lands for salvation. Hey, maybe we'll meet on the other side. Wouldn't that be awesome? No. Don't drag me down with you. Come on. Just relax for once. Now, it's time. 
I'm starting to get woozy, so the stuff is kicking in. In fact, I'm starting to feel a connection between us. Can you feel that? It's like we've become connected. The woman spoke as the serum started to kick in, and SS008 was stunned. He could in fact feel a connection to her. It was faint, but it was strengthening over time. It was like some kind of sixth sense, and they could almost begin to feel each other through it. It was incredibly odd, and SS08 started to properly freak out. What the hell is this? Ha ha. I have no idea. But hey, now we have a super special bond. Maybe we'll fly with each other across time and space. Now, we should hurry and enter. Are you ready? Smiling broadly, the woman got behind his hospital bed and prepared to push. In front of him was the portal, otherwise known as death. Arg! Damn it all! Ha ha ha! Here we go! SS008 yelled in frustration. He couldn't do anything, and he was being dragged along with this crazy psychopath who he now had some weird connection with. She just laughed though, and with her words, she pushed the bed forward. To freedom! Ag! With a laugh and a roar, two people entered the portal. Moments later, the entire room exploded with a bright flash. The super-secret hideout was annihilated, along with it the greatest technological pieces of work in the world. Foreign Entity Detected Evaluating Entity Human Soul Detected Evaluating Human Attributes Attributes Detected Attributes Assigned Inherent Traits Detected Traits Assigned Skills Assigned Profile complete. Searching for suitable vessel. Compatible vessel found. Assigning vessel. Descending soul. Wah! Wah! Congratulations, madam. It's a boy! Inside of a luxurious bedroom, a maid who was acting as a midwife cleaned a baby and then handed it to the mother who recently gave birth. The mother tenderly held the boy who slowly started to calm down and stop crying. He is pale skin, but we checked him and he's perfectly healthy. Thank you. He probably got that from his father Dash. Bang! Honey? How'd it go? Sorry I'm late. Suddenly, a man dressed in a cloak busted into the room. He quickly laid eyes on his wife with the child in her arms. It's a boy. A boy. Ha ha. That makes it even now, huh? Ah. Wah. Wah. Ugh, honey. Tone it down, will you? Sorry, sorry. Sheepishly chuckling, the cloaked man made his way over to the bed while removing his hood, revealing a pale but exquisite face. He took a look at his child in his wife's arms who was startled by his roaring voice. After the child calmed again, the man spoke. Hmm, so since it's a boy, which name are we choosing? Both parents looked at the child, pondering. After some time, the man spoke. Arlo? No. Why not? Just, no. Fine. Rolling his eyes, the man went back to pondering. The next moment though, his eyes lit up. I got it. How about Dirk? Dirk. It's not bad. Ha ha ha. Yes. That's it. From now on, this boy shall be named Dirk Strider, fourth child of the noble Strider household. Laughing in celebration, the man declared the child's name. The mother didn't object, meaning she gave her approval. Meanwhile, the child, who had gained the consciousness of a recently arrived soul, stared up at the two adults in front of him with baffling confusion. Chapter 4, Sorcery Slash Interface What the hell is going on? SS008 realized that he had miraculously survived entering the portal. After that though, everything went dark, and after an unknown amount of time, he found himself in a new body. That body though was that of a baby's. As he barely opened his weak eyes and took in the sights around him, he was bewildered. Am I seriously in the body of a child? SS008 felt helpless. Everything felt stuffy and restrained, 
as if he was tied up in a straight jacket. And it wasn't just because of the blanket he was bundled in, though that did add to that sense. The body, and how he could use his senses but had no control over himself was annoying. It was like being paralyzed. You understood your situation, but there was nothing you could do, and you could only lay there. He hated the feeling. More than that though, he felt off the way he was. He was being held by some woman, and both she and the father were staring at him with excited and tender eyes. Being looked at with those eyes made him uncomfortable. The only form of intimacy he ever had was talking smack with Gray, his sergeant. Never in his life did he know the gaze of a mother. But with the state he was in now, he could only helplessly accept it. Though, he could close his eyes in an attempt to avoid the gaze, something that actually worked rather well. It made him less antsy. There was one more problem as well. He couldn't understand a word they were saying. They were speaking in some foreign language, one that wasn't one of the several languages he had learned from Earth. He laid in his mother's arms for a while as the midwife in the room prepared some basic items like water and some kind of vial full of an unknown substance. This vial was applied on his new mother who had been hurt during the birth, and while SS-008 didn't see the application or what it did, he noticed his mother greatly relax not long after. He assumed it was some kind of numbing ointment or the like. After that though came the weird part. As Dirk minded his own business, his face was suddenly touched. He opened his eyes to see his mother poking him and undoing her clothes, revealing a medium-sized breast. His thoughts sank as he realized what was happening, and his lips slammed shut. He still couldn't accept his reality. This was much to the distress of his mother, but after the midwife consoled her, she eventually put her chest back, prompting SS-008 to relax. Sheesh. This is not okay. Am I seriously supposed to suck that? I don't want to, but I don't think I can avoid it forever. He frowned inwardly as he felt hunger creeping up. It wasn't bad now, but he knew it would get worse. And since he really was a baby, he knew it probably wasn't healthy to starve himself. This wasn't his other body. Ah, whatever. Just, trudge through it. It's just like boot camp, except less yelling and more embarrassment. SS-008 steeled himself for the helpless life of a weak child. Unfortunately, he wasn't sure how well he would be able to hold out when he had to deal with the incredibly odd sensation of crapping himself. It really was like he was back in training all over again, getting his pride stripped away one humiliation at a time. Eventually, he started feeling incredibly drowsy, so much so that he couldn't resist it and fell asleep in his mother's arms. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary for the two parents who were still reveling in the euphoria of getting another kid. It wasn't long before he woke up again, though when he did, he secretly hoped that the previous events were only a dream. Unfortunately, reality wasn't so nice, and peeing himself immediately after waking was enough to bring him to terms with his new life. Trying his best to disregard relieving himself so blatantly, SS-008 looked around and found himself in a crib within an empty room. He was unaware if he had slept for an hour or a day, but that didn't matter too much. Not long after he woke, some people opened the door to his room and walked in with shining eyes. Oh my god! He's so cute! A young girl quickly but quietly walked over to the crib followed by a boy, another much younger girl, and their father. SS-008 didn't understand anything, but he did his best to remember the sounds of the words spoken by these people. The girl, one who looked no older than eight, the boy who looked five, and the seemingly youngest girl who looked four, all came over next to the crib and looked at SS-008 as if he were a monkey. He just looked back at them, and some assumptions were made. This must be my family. Two sisters and a brother. That's the father right there, and the mom is probably sleeping. He memorized their faces as they stared at each other. After a bit though, the father picked him up and handed him to the oldest girl who carefully cradled him as if he were the most precious thing in the world. He stayed silent through it all, much to the surprise of the father who expected him to cry. He was then passed around to the boy, who only held him for a few seconds, and then the smallest girl who held him the longest. 
After some time, the other two siblings left while this little girl continued to hold SS-008 under the watch of her father. The mother soon appeared though, and after receiving SS-008, she sat down in a chair and undid her robe, revealing that same perky breast. SS-008 hesitated again, but after sleeping for a while, he noticed the hunger overcome him once more. There was also some kind of instinct that made the temptation to suckle surprisingly strong. He could resist, but after deliberating for a bit and seeing his mother's sad and worried face, he gave in and went to town. This finally kick-started his life as a baby, one that was surprisingly mundane. Six months pass. Spending more time around his family that took care of him every day, SS008 learned many things. First, as he had seen before, he wasn't the only child of this couple. This household was apparently called the Strider household, a noble household, and there were four children in total, him being the youngest. The oldest child was the eight-year-old girl, the second oldest was the boy, the third was the other girl, and then he was the fourth, a boy. Two girls, two boys. He had learned their names too. From first to third, they were Viola, Ethan, and Rita. The mother was also called Cecilia, and the father was called Riker. Finally, there was his name. His name was Dirk. Dirk Strider. When he learned his name, he didn't really know how to feel. He had always gone by SS008, his designation number. Although he had nicknames, those were what other people called him. He only ever knew his designation number, so getting a proper name was new for him. He came to accept it though. It wasn't like he could insist on his designation number, and now that he had been betrayed by the people who created him, he wasn't very fond of his designation. Now that he thought of it, it was like a leash. He had been treated like a hunting dog for so long, and with this new name, he could finally let go of his past. He could create a new identity. Maybe that psycho had a point. A new life, huh? Maybe I can work with this. Thinking that, he felt an odd sense of relief wash over him. He had lost the one person close to him and was tossed away when he was no longer needed, but with this, he could start over. He would just tuck away the name Gray into his heart and move forward, leaving everything else behind. Now, he was Dirk. It was an odd name, but it was his. With his renewed sense of humanity, Dirk went on to observe his new family as much as he could. This wasn't that difficult since they would often come to him. The oldest daughter, Viola, would often come and take care of him in her mother's stead. She was only eight years old, as he thought. The others were only two years apart from each other with Ethan being six and Rita being four. Anyway, being curious children, they would all come and either play with him or take care of him. Ethan would sometimes go to him and try to demonstrate his skill with a wooden sword, and other times Rita would come and play with little wooden dolls with him. He would always just sit there though, staring at them dumbly like his skull was empty. This was just his antisocial behavior poking out though. He didn't really know how to maneuver these kids, so he just kind of let them do their thing while responding to any of their inquiries with an empty e sound. Despite his lack of responsiveness though, he was always taking in everything around him. Because of that, he was able to learn the language his family spoke rather quickly. Somewhat anyway. When the children talked normally, he could mostly understand their intent. Only some words threw him off, but being a baby, he wasn't really able to ask around and inquire about them. With that, he was slowly able to understand the lifestyle of these people. This house was definitely a noble house, and the place was luxurious and large. For a while, Dirk thought he was sent to some well-developed medieval world. However, as he observed for a while, he was able to see an absolutely shocking phenomenon. One day when his mother was preparing some food to eat, something that didn't happen often since there were maids to do everything, Dirk had been sitting near her watching. She prepared a bunch of food in a pot to throw it in just for him. And then, when she went to go light the stove, she actually conjured a flame from her hand which she put up against the stove, thus activating and lighting it like a gas burner. Except, it definitely wasn't a gas burner, and other than some weird glowing object, Dirk saw nothing that could eject gas to burn for flame. But there was flame being produced. It simply wasn't possible. 
Seeing all that, Dirk was thrown for a wild ride mentally. He couldn't understand what happened, and desperate to learn more, he started making babbling noises and grasped out toward her palm where she conjured the flame. Just a minute, sweetie. I've gotta cook the food before you can eat it. That was the only response he got from his mother though, and he almost smacked his forehead hearing that. Damn it, woman. I wanna know what kind of sorcery that is. Cursing in his mind, he continued to try and draw attention to the fire, but his mother couldn't understand him. Eventually, he gave up and just watched. Luckily, that was only the first of many demonstrations he would see. Sometimes, his mother would activate a stone device that could magically spew out water for baths, and even the maids who took care of the house would conjure water for some of their cleaning. Not only that, but whenever the maids went to go and air out the house, they would open up windows and wave their arms, causing a strong wind to kick up and blow throughout the place. Dirk tried to see all the demonstrations he could in order to grasp what was happening. Because of this, he started attempting to take control of his body and move around. This goal had actually been something he constantly worked on, and because of that, when he was around eight months old, he was able to totally walk on his own. Once he got walking and even speed walking down, he was able to have much more freedom and could clearly communicate what he wanted. While his parents were shocked at his fast growth and the maids got nervous due to his new ability to explore, he wasn't worried about that and just pointed his way to learning about sorcery. Finally, his mother was able to figure out what he was interested in and showed a conjured ball of water to him up close. See, sweetie? It's water. We summon these elements using magic. I wonder, can you feel the mana through your body? Ma. Ma na. Yes. Mana. That's right. He, such a good boy. After barely blabbering out the word mana, his mother clapped in joy and gave him a big hug. Dirk accepted the hug gladly. Maybe he could get some of this mana by being in close proximity to her and conjure his own flames or water. Sigh. Such a good boy. I really can't wait until you're able to speak and can open your profile. Mother is interested in learning about your attributes, but unfortunately your father doesn't allow an appraisal until you're four. Dirk tilted his head hearing his mother and thoughts ran through his head. Profile? Do I need to say it out oh? Surprised, Dirk suddenly saw something pop up in his face. It was a series of text. Profile. Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, Zero. Attributes, Fire, Earth, Darkness. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface. What the? What is all this? Dirk stared off into space and read the text. As he did, he started connecting some dots. These traits. Cybernetic enhancement. Could they be what I have from Earth? That stuff carried over? And that skill? I still have my AI interface. Since when? Hey, activate interface. Initializing interface. Ha! Huh. It really is there. Dirk got excited when he heard that familiar robotic voice. He didn't know how it was still with him, but he was glad to have it. The only thing he was mad about was the fact that it was dormant all the time. You damn thing could have kept me occupied. It's super boring in this body. Scanning host. Dirk shook his head as he thought about all the long hours of doing nothing. In all his life he had never been so idle, and he constantly itched to do literally anything except for peeing himself. As he waited, the AI went through its boot-up process. Host scanned. Constructing model. Model constructed. Host age, 8 months. Blood type, AB+. Skeletal structure, organic iron composite, developing. Muscle structure, high power compacted fibers, developing. Sensory organs, high density receptors, developing. Self-replicating nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems, offline. Final stand weapon system, offline. Overdrive systems, offline. Current bodily state, combat incapable, 100% healthy, developing. Warning! 
unable to construct nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems. Insufficient chemical energy production. Warning. Unable to construct final stand weapon system. Insufficient chemical energy production. Insufficient mineral reserves. Warning. Unable to activate overdrive. Insufficient chemical energy production. Intelligence systems fully functional. Awaiting host orders. With that, the AI finished its procedures. Dirk was confused though. Are my other systems not present? That sucks. I guess I can't expect absolutely everything to carry over. Plus, I guess those were more like auxiliary augmentations anyway. Dirk sighed as he thought about the other cybernetic systems he had. He had augments that could bond with his weapons and suits to give him overlays, and he also had an invisibility skin. Unfortunately, it looked like he wouldn't get to use those anymore. Gone were the days of receiving the most exceptional tech in the world built specifically for his use. However, he was still happy about having the enhanced internal systems. Stronger bones and muscles and better senses. It was all an edge he could use in battle. Heh, they sank hundreds of millions into my body alone, and now I'm gone. Talk about a loss in investment. Though, I guess if it was for the serum to travel to a different world, I can see how that trade-off would have been worth it. Except now, they have neither. He smiled as he thought about how much the government must be bleeding. They lost their best soldier, all the tech behind the portal and serums, and the president was assassinated. He could hardly imagine the pandemonium going on on Earth. It filled him with a bit of joy. Mph, whatever. That's all behind me now. I should just focus on this magic stuff now. Pushing other thoughts away, Dirk continued to stick around his mother in order to hopefully learn about this magic stuff. Being a baby, he had nothing else to focus on other than what he wanted. He was gradually getting used to a more relaxed lifestyle that wasn't full of classified operations and following orders. Another six months pass, and Dirk is now 14 months old. By now, Dirk could basically run, and the control he had over his body was increasing day by day. He was also learning to talk. Well, he already knew how to talk. Over time, he continued to learn the language and now had no trouble understanding anything anyone said. He could also speak sentences of his own as his vocal cords were developed. However, he tended to keep the sentences short and his words shallow. He didn't need to start talking like an adult as a child. Besides, him talking coherently with sentences was already shocking to his parents enough. Another thing Dirk made sure to do was learn how to use the bathroom properly. He dreaded the creeping feelings of his bowels moving and would not crap his diapers any longer than he had to. So, he potty trained himself, much to the happiness of his mother and the maids that took care of him, i.e. changed his diapers. With that, Dirk continued to be allowed to do more things. He was eating food with the family like a normal kid, albeit soft food, he could wander within the confines of the manor they lived in, and he could see and learn more things. Turns out, while Dirk kind of knew that his family had a rather high status, he didn't really grasp that until now. The manor, or mansion, that his family lived in was three stories tall and covered a large plot of land. This wasn't just any plot of land though. This land was within the walls of a city, and not far from them was a huge castle. Dirk had only seen all this when he looked beyond the rooms of the house for the first time. His mother took him up on a balcony, and from there he could see a large city with tall, magnificent buildings. There was also that huge castle, which from his view, stood like a tall stone skyscraper. His mother spoke while they were overlooking everything, and this was the information Dirk got, they were nobles in the city of Erelon. This city was the capital city of the empire known as Horizon, and also the city where the emperor resided, hence the castle. Apparently, his father was a marquis. This position was below a duke, whose position was under the emperor. Hearing that, Dirk was surprised. So I've been born into an elite family. I guess that's kind of nice, but... Dirk's thoughts drifted there. To go from an orphan found in the slums, to a soldier who for all intents and purposes didn't exist, to now being the child of a high-ranking noble, was an odd twist of fate to say the least. 
to think his life would go through such a change. He didn't know what to think of it. He didn't even have parents before this, and now he was getting all this good stuff. Do I deserve all this? What on earth did I do right to get put into this position? Dirk's mind was turbulent. Having all this time to himself meant he was thinking a lot, and that wasn't something he normally did. While he did start to read books and realize the concept of thinking for himself toward the end of his life on earth, it was still a new thing. If it were during the early days of being a soldier, he would have slit his own throat if the president asked him to. Now though, he had some semblance of self to understand the notion of freedom. Freedom of both mind and body. This led him to do what he did and rebel against an injustice. And now, he was being given all this natural freedom. He wouldn't be bound by a superior, he wouldn't be put on a leash like a dog. He was a rather privileged child now, but he didn't know how to process that feeling. All this time, his psyche was gradually changing. The old him was dying, and the new him was sprouting. But that wasn't easy, changing who he was. Luckily, he didn't have a choice. He could only suffer through the changes while being bound by the body of a child. He had no choice but to accept the love his mother gave him, because if he didn't, she would get sad. He was forced to reciprocate weird feelings like affection. It was as uncomfortable for him as it was weirdly enlivening and enlightening. I guess this isn't so bad though. I guess. I could enjoy it a little. No, I want to enjoy it. This isn't Earth anymore. No more superiors, no more being ordered around. I get to do things my way. At least, if I can find out what to do with myself. My siblings talk about magic a lot, so is that what I'm gonna do when I'm older? That sounds fun. With those thoughts, Dirk unconsciously smiled while being held by his mother. Without him knowing it, the aversion toward compassion and affection was slowly being driven out of him, and a new sense of companionship and independence sprouted within. Chapter 5, Duke Kilshire A few more months pass, and Dirk is two years old. With his increasing levels of freedom, he was able to spend more time interacting with his siblings and doing some activities. During these things, he learned even more new details about them. For one, Rita, his sister that was just above him in age, wasn't entirely human. He had noticed early on, but she had ears with a tall point on the end. At first he didn't really think anything of it, but as time went on, he inquired about it, and he actually learned that she was primarily an elf. According to his mother, his father, Riker, was a human and elf hybrid from a faraway empire. Rita had apparently inherited most of those elf genes making her a majority elf hybrid. Not only that, but his oldest sibling and sister, Viola, was a half and half hybrid. This was the reason for her looks being well above average. She apparently took the best of both worlds, her mother's human beauty and her father's elven beauty. Ethan though, his older brother, was just a human, as was he. Ethan wasn't a bad-looking kid though, albeit his nature was a bit wild, something he apparently took from the mother. Another thing he came to learn about was magical attributes. Dirk had seen them on his profile, but he didn't really know what they were or meant. This was solved though as he started to watch his siblings train. From what he took away from inference, conversations between the siblings, and some tactful questions, attributes represented your affinity toward a certain element. If someone had the fire attribute, that meant they had an affinity toward the fire element and could use fire magic. It was the same for other elements like wind, water, and earth. In addition to those though, there were the dark element and light element. Dirk's father had great affinities toward fire and wind, and because of this, he was a very skilled warlock. Dirk's mother had an affinity toward earth and dark, and she was apparently a master swordswoman. Then there was Viola who had affinities toward wind and earth, Ethan who had an exclusive affinity for fire, and Rita who had an exclusive affinity for the dark element. All his siblings were apparently very gifted. Just because you had an attribute didn't mean your affinity was high. However, all his siblings had high affinities for their elements. Especially Rita, who had a perfect affinity for the dark element. So while Dirk knew he had three attributes for fire, earth, and dark, he didn't know how high his affinity was. 
luckily though, the time to figure everything out was fast approaching. According to a tradition set by his father, each child was appraised at four years of age. That time for Dirk was coming, and needless to say, the expectations were high. He wasn't nervous though. He at least knew he had attributes, so unless his affinities were absolute trash, then he would be fine. Besides, he had his other personal traits, and his knowledge of combat was extensive. Even if he were a normal human all by himself, he was a force to be reckoned with. Speaking of traits though, as the date approached for his appraisal and he continued to grow, Dirk started to experience some weird things. Ever since the discovery of the profile and the activation of his AI interface, he's noticed some weird energies that mysteriously appeared around him. He found that there were two separate energies that were ever-present throughout the atmosphere, and they flowed everywhere like a fog in a wind. It was weird because he couldn't actually touch them or feel them, but he could sense them. At first, he assumed that this was the mana that his mother spoke of, some kind of magical energy. But there were two energies, and he couldn't really understand the functions of either. However, after observing for some time and growing for a while, his sense that detected these energies grew more distinct. When he approached three years of age, Dirk was able to sense one of the energies more clearly, and they appeared to him with special traits. He could sense a fiery and electric energy, a strong and metallic energy, and then a dark and shadowy energy. These three elements flickered through the atmosphere, and because they were the elements associated with his attributes, he quickly determined that this energy was mana, the magical energy by which his mother and siblings could conjure spells. As for the second energy, he still didn't know. Either way, when he discovered this, he was rather excited. Whenever he tried to reach out toward a flickering electric spark, it would come to his hand. He was able to exert some control over the elemental energy, though directing it toward him was about the limits of his control. At most, he was able to bring the energy into his body and hold it there for a bit, something that gave him a nice clarity of mind like meditation. That was enough for him though. As a child with nothing to do except watch other people, being able to mess around with some weird magical energy like a wizard was nice. With that and his AI interface, he was able to keep himself occupied. Dirk! Today's the day! Are you ready? A young female voice rang out. Dirk, who was in his bedroom, watched as his older sister Rita barged in with an excited smile. Good morning, Ridoof. He, good morning. Dirk smiled as Rita ran over and tackled him, sending them both to the floor in a hug. Dirk was now four years old, and Rita was eight. Rita's elf ears had become more defined, her hair had somehow become blacker, almost dripping darkness, and her refined face had become even brighter and cuter. Dirk had also gotten bigger, although he was still the smallest in the family. As time passed, Rita and Dirk had come to grow the closest as they were the closest in age. Well, Rita and her older brother Ethan were closer in age, but Rita wasn't compatible with her older brother that had grown more rambunctious and wild. She liked Dirk more who was the quiet one in the family. Plus, as she had come to observe Dirk, she was actually able to discover his affinity toward the dark element, which she had a perfect affinity toward. From then on, she liked to spend all her time with him. Hey, aren't you excited? You get a praise today. You seem more excited than me. It's a big deal. You finally get to see your affinities. Maybe you'll have a perfect affinity like me for the dark element. I doubt that. Hey, you never know. Now come on. Everyone is waiting at the table. Pulling Dirk by the arm, Rita dragged him out of the room and they both headed down to the dining room. There, Dirk's mother and father as well as his two other siblings were preparing to eat. When Dirk sat, he observed his family. Viola, the oldest sibling and sister, was now twelve years old. Her ears had a small point that wasn't as tall as Rita's but still displayed her elven traits. Her dirty blonde hair flowed down just past her shoulders, but as she usually liked to put it, it was done up in a ponytail, keeping out of the way. Her eyes shone with green as she looked at Dirk with a smile. Ethan, the oldest brother, was now a large kid with muscles starting to poke out from his developing body. His hair was wild and blonde with a slight red hue that represented his fiery nature and attribute toward flame. 
His eyes though were solid red, and he almost looked like a dragon as he smirked toward the small Dirk. Dirk's father, Riker, was also looking at him with an anticipatory glance. Riker was a tall and slender man with some elven features standing at a tall six feet five inches. His face was pale, and he was usually seen wearing a cloak with some fancy robes underneath. He almost always had a large book with him as well, and as Dirk came to find out, he was a very accomplished magician who did some work in a magic school. As for Dirk's mother, she was the only one who seemed more anxious than anything. She was a pretty woman who usually wore moderate clothing and donned her brown hair in a bun. Standing at five feet six inches, she didn't seem like much at first glance, but Dirk knew that she was an exceptionally skilled and strong fighter who used a rapier as her weapon. These people watched as Dirk and Rita took a seat. When the last maid set the rest of the table, they all dug in. Dirk especially. Because of his cybernetics and unique body structure and developing composition, he needed all the nutrients and energy he could get. The only person who out ate him was Ethan despite him being so much smaller. For a while, everyone was silent and food like meats, fruits, and bread was cleared quickly. Eventually, Dirk's father, Riker, finished and spoke as everyone else ate. Today, we're going to head to the Duke's household where the three of you got appraised. Dirk will be getting appraised there. We leave after you all finish eating and dressing in semi-formal attire. Understood? Yes, father. Okay. Yes, sir. Viola nodded, and the others gave their acknowledgement. Riker frowned at Ethan though, who spoke with a mouthful of food. Don't speak when you chew. Have you not learned any manners? And why can't you address me with sir like Dirk? Gulp. Mph. I don't even know where he got that from. Why do we need to call our own father sir anyway? Maybe he got it from his sense of respect toward his father, as you should have, you runt. I am not a runt. Dirk watched the exchange between his brother and father and chuckled inwardly. I say sir because it's more habitual than anything. I guess father enjoys that. After finishing their meal, everyone left for their rooms and prepared themselves. Dirk walked into a walk-in closet that had many different clothes, footwear, accessories, and other fashion items. For the rest of the family, maids would come in and help dress them, making sure everything was nice and pristine. For Dirk though, not only did he not enjoy that, but his ability to dress himself was perfect as per his previous life's training. After finding out that Dirk never needed help despite being four years old and that he didn't enjoy being assisted, Maids never came in to help dress him anymore. After finding the semi-formal clothes, Dirk proceeded to put everything on systematically. He threw on a silk shirt that was tapered to his size, then some cloth pants. Upon putting on the pants, the waist suddenly glowed and shrunk down to his size automatically, fitting nice and snug. This was the magical alternative to elastic, something that had stunned Dirk upon seeing it for the first time. After throwing on the pants and shirt, he then put on a doublet that was this world's equivalent to a jacket or vest. The doublet was a blue semi-casual taper, and it went well with his black pants. After that Dirk slipped on some leather shoes that were surprisingly comfortable despite the stiff appearance. After cleaning his face and brushing his hair to the side, Dirk went and sat on his bed to wait. Raising his hand, he looked toward the elements that flowed around him. Electric sparks black wisps, and metal shards. Of course, they weren't actually material, but that's how Dirk was able to see them flowing around him. With a finger, he went and poked an electric spark. The chunk of mana was controlled and brought over his palm where more continued to gather. He soon had a tiny ball of electricity flowing above his hand, and through strong concentration, he was able to prevent it from dissipating. Knock knock. Young master, the family awaits. Suddenly, a knock came from the door, and from it a maid's voice. Dirk's attention was diverted, and the ball of sparks dissipated. I'll be down soon. Responding to the maid, Dirk didn't mind the dissipated ball and left the room, heading downstairs. There he is. Since we're ready, let's go. Seeing Dirk, Riker nodded. The rest of the family was already downstairs and waiting. 
the women like Cecilia and Viola and Rita were dressed in classy dresses that weren't overly dramatic. Riker had taken off his cloak and was donned in nice robes, and Ethan was dressed in somewhat formal clothes like a shirt, jacket, and slim pants similar to Dirk. Walking outside the manor, a large pathway with grass and plants all around it was seen. This manor was gated in and away from the normal outside city. The location it was in was an area of the city where other Marquises resided, and through the gate that led outside the property, they could see a long empty street along with other gates that led to other manors. We're taking the carriage, so hop in. Really? Yay! Riker spoke and Rita cheered as they walked through the gate of the property. Outside was a large carriage that looked almost similar to a large supply truck, except much fancier and designed to transport people. Excited, the other siblings quickly ran over and boarded. Dirk didn't know what was so great about it, but he also got in and sat himself next to Rita who pulled him over. The next moment, the carriage turned and drove like a car down the street. It quickly gained speed, and using his senses, Dirk could detect strong fluctuations in the man around him. Soon, while looking through a window, Dirk saw the carriage actually rise into the air. With wide eyes, all the children looked out the windows of the carriages. They had risen high into the air and could see the large city below them. The many buildings that stretched out as far as the eye could see, the huge castle that everything seemed to be based around, and all the tiny dots of people on the floor that flooded through all the streets like ants. That combined with a bright and sunny day made for a miraculous view. Of course, Dirk wasn't that impressed with the view. He had seen plenty of massive cities in his days. What he was baffled about was the fact that this carriage could fly. He looked to his father about to ask what this was, but the man seemed to predict the question and spoke. This carriage runs off of a thing called magic crystals that power wind enchantments on the carriage. The wind element around us is sucked in and used to help us fly. Usually it's a very expensive form of transportation, but I happen to be an excellent wind mage and can greatly increase the efficiency. His father spoke that last part smugly with a smile. Dirk thought it was definitely something to be proud of though. To be able to help a carriage with six people in it fly was an amazing feat. Anyway, the friend we're going to be meeting is named Duke Hillshire. He's an exceptionally powerful wind mage and warrior that I had once fought and studied alongside. Each child of mine has been appraised by his appraiser who's one of the best in the city. She'll be able to accurately tell your affinities. You just need to follow along, all right, Dirk? Yes, sir. Good. Now, we should be coming up on his residence shortly. Saying that, the family flew for a few more minutes before slowing down and landing on another runway street. Out of the windows, they could see a residence that was even bigger than theirs, fitted with statues, fountains, and carried a heavy magical aura. The family exited the carriage when it came to a stop and got a better view. They all took deep breaths unconsciously, taking in both the fresh, serene air as well as the dense manna that was like a fog in Dirk's magical senses. Welcome, Marquis Strider. A man came walking up to the family not long after. He was a middle-aged man with slightly graying hairs but a healthy complexion dressed in a nice suit. Seeing him, Dirk's father smiled and went to greet the man. Butler Gordon. It's nice to see you. You as well, Marquis. I hear we have a new addition to the family. Yes, indeed. This is Dirk, my fourth child. Dirk, come give your greetings. A pleasure to meet you, Butler Gordon. Walking over, Dirk was about to subconsciously click his heels together and salute. However, remembering the new etiquette he had been taught, he forcefully relaxed his tightening muscles and placed his right fist over his chest, the national salute and greeting toward superiors in this empire. Seeing his rigid and perfect greeting, the butler just chuckled and also saluted. It's also a pleasure, young Master Dirk. Are you ready for your appraisal? Yes, sir. Very good. The Duke and appraiser are waiting in the hall, if you would follow me. Thank you for your time. Hoo hoo, of course, young master. Smiling widely, the butler turned and led the family toward the duke's manor. Riker also smiled, proud of his son's manners and humble etiquette. 
With the butler leading them, the family walked to the large double doors that led into the manor. After pushing them open, they walked into a hall where another family was waiting for them. Strider. Still going crazy with the children, eh? Ha. Ah. You're one to talk. Tell me again how many children you've had. I lost count at fifteen. Two booming voices filled the hall as Riker and the Duke saw each other. The Duke, a muscular blonde man, stood in the center of the hall with his family behind him consisting of his pregnant wife and five other children, two of which looked like young adults. The two men smiled and gave each other a hearty hug, the friendship between both clear for all to see. Cecilia, Dirk's mother, also went over to greet the wife of the Duke. Who said crazy was a bad thing? We have long lives, Strider. Why not fill it with children? Having any children at your level is a hard thing to achieve. To think you have almost twenty now baffles me. Indeed. They're all my little miracles. Now, is this the new addition? He looks pale, just like you. Smiling, the Duke approached Dirk who smoothly saluted him. Greetings, Duke Hillshire. Ha ha. Nice manners, kid. Dirk, right? Yes sir. Right. You know, your soul seems rather good when I take a close look. Kneeling down, the Duke made himself eye level with Dirk. His brown pupils looked directly into Dirk's. Meeting his gaze, Dirk's neck tingled. It felt like the Duke's gaze could pierce him, and he felt like a small rabbit in front of a saber tooth. He had never felt such pressure before. Hmm. Yes, your soul, your presence. It's fresh, but vague. Do you see something, Duke? Hmm. Strider, I'm thinking you're going to have another talent. The Duke smiled and stood up, leaving Dirk to slightly stumble. Hearing the Duke, Riker grinned brightly. Is that right? Maybe. Who knows? I might just be totally wrong. I trust in my judgment, though. Now, why don't we get this little one appraised? After that, only time will tell how talented he is. Chapter 6 Appraisal Slash Academy Dirk, this is Akasa. She will be doing your appraisal. Hello, Dirk. A woman walked over and kneeled down in front of Dirk after the Duke backed away. She was a short lady who didn't look older than twenty. She had on a red embroidered robe and carried a book in her hands. Hello, miss. Calming the mental turbulence caused by the Duke's stare, Dirk slowed his breathing and greeted the lady. She smiled sweetly at him. The process is simple. Grab my hands, and then I'm going to stream some mana through you. It might be a bit uncomfortable, but don't resist and it'll be over soon. Okay. Good. Then let's start. Letting go of the book, the woman used magic to make it float in between them. It then started flipping pages until it landed on a blank one. She put out her two palms, which Dirk put his own hands on top of. After feeling her smooth palms and fingers, she sent through some white mana. Dirk felt the energy flow into his left arm, and as she said, it was indeed uncomfortable, like someone was violating you. Something about someone else's mana entering your body made you vulnerable. Dirk didn't really care much about it though and just let it be. However, there was another part of him that had a different reaction. Warning! Foreign power entering host's body. Blocking mana channels. Suddenly, Dirk's body seemed to close itself off to Akasa's mana and attempted to eject it. Akasa noticed this, but didn't think much of it. Just relax yourself. I know it feels weird, but I promise it won't do anything to you. Right. Sorry. Nodding, Dirk turned his attention to the AI. Hey! Deactivate defenses. Open up the channel. Are you sure you wish to dash? Yes. Let her mana through. Opening mana channels. With that, the mana was no longer blocked and proceeded to flow up his arm. Once it reached his shoulder, it flowed across his chest and down his other arm, creating a loop of mana. With this loop, some of his power seemed to be sucked in and flowed along with her own mana. 
it was then sent out of his body and out between them into the book where runes started to write themselves on the blank page. After a few minutes, a few lines of runes were on the page, and Akasa cut her mana stream. Their hands separated, and Akasa took a look at the book before translating the runes and taking out the page, handing it to Riker. Riker walked over and grabbed the page from Akasa, who stood up and walked to the side. After reading it, he smiled. Hillshire, looks like your judgment wasn't wrong. Oh? I'm glad my intuition is still sharp. Indeed. Come here, Dirk. Take a look. Riker waved his son over. Dirk eagerly moved, interested in what it said. Looking at the page, he found his three attributes. The first was the fire attribute, then the earth, then there was darkness. However, each one now had another word next to it. Beside fire, it said lightning, and beside earth, it said metal. Darkness had no additional word. There's some things you should know about your attributes. First, your fire attribute. It has the lightning tag on there. That means that you have a specialized version of the attribute, one that allows you to control lightning on top of flames. Second, your earth attribute which has the metal tag. It's also a specialized version, and you'll have much greater control over metals. As for your dark attribute, it's normal. Now, take a look at the affinities for each one. Your affinity is how well you'll be able to tap into your elemental attribute, but since you have specialized attributes, each attribute has two affinities. Look! Riker pointed at the numbers on the page, and as Dirk concentrated on them, the AI automatically recorded the document he was looking at. Attributes Fire 71%, Lightning 89%, Earth 88%, Metal 93%, Dark 92%. Anima True Seeing the numbers, Dirk was surprised. While none of them were perfect, they were all very high. And guessing from the wide smile on his father's face, it was very impressive. However, there was one outlier Anima. He didn't recognize that word. Father, what's this anima? Oh, that's the energy used for body refinement. We have much to teach you, but putting it simply, you either have the attribute or you don't. There's not really an affinity for it. Oh. Can I see? What's his dark affinity at? Hold on. Let your mother see first. As Rita eagerly came over to get a look, Riker stopped her and handed the sheet to his wife. Taking it, she took a quick look and smiled. Very nice. We'll have to discuss whether or not he comes under my tutelage in the future. Indeed. All right, Rita, you can take a look. Well, as long as Dirk is okay with it. It's fine, father. Yay! Let me see. After getting his consent, Rita excitedly ran over to her mother and looked at the paper in her hands. Viola and Ethan also went over to take a look. Ha! Huh. My fire attribute is higher. Of course it's higher, you tard. You have a 90% affinity. Unless his was near perfect, it wouldn't top yours. Plus, he's got lightning. Don't get cocky. Viola reprimanded Ethan who started getting competitive. He just snorted and turned his head away. Yay! Your affinity is high. Hey Dirk, we should practice dark magic together. Rita came over and grabbed Dirk's hand, waving it up and down excitedly. Dirk smiled and agreed to her arrangement while chuckling inwardly about how enthusiastic she was. It was nice having a good sister. Hey Dirk, do you mind if the Duke sees your affinities? That's fine. You sure? If you don't want people seeing it, it's okay to say so. It's fine. Ha, ah, thanks little one. Now, let me see how spot on my guess was. Smiling at his trust, Duke Hillshire went and received the paper from Cecilia. He took a second to read it before breaking out in roaring laughter. Ha ha ha. That's what I thought. A three-attribute mage. And you can train body refinement. Hey kid. A little advice for you. Don't skimp out on body refinement. Mages should be both tough and smart. When you're ready, 
I'll let you come pick out a training manual like your older brother and sister. You can start training it early like them too. You're four years old now, so come back when you're ten. That's the time people usually begin their journey on the path of strength. Understood. Thank you, sir. Of course. Now, why don't you all stick around for lunch? I've got a nice feast planned. Me and Strider also have some catching up to do. That would be lovely, do Kilshire. Thank you. Cecilia answered, thanking the Duke in advance. It's no problem at all. Now, the garden is in the back. Why don't you kids go and play for a couple hours? Garden! Come on, Dirk. Let's go play. Hearing there was a garden, Rita beamed and grabbed Dirk, heading to where the Duke pointed. He just followed along, as did the other siblings. Smiling at the kids, the parents watched as they ran off before turning back toward each other. The Duke led Riker into another room while the two wives went off to talk about their own matters. Hey Dirk! You up? Dirk's eyes fluttered open when he heard the voice outside his bedroom door. Looking at the window on one of the walls, he found that the sun was rising. I'm up. He, good morning. Hearing his words, the door flew open. Rita came skipping and dressed in a gown. She obviously hadn't changed before coming to wake him up, something she enjoyed doing for some reason unbeknownst to Dirk. Hey! Are you ready for today? Yes, I am. Good. It's going to be exciting. School entrances are so fun. Rita clapped excitedly as she thought about the events that were planned later today. Today was the day that school officially opened for young children between the ages of 6 and 10. Every year, the school would host an entrance event allowing kids and their parents to tour the place, enjoying various festivities and preparing the new kids for their new life at school. Rita had entered the school when she was 6. Now, not only was she starting her fourth year, but Dirk was also going to be joining. Two years had passed since the appraisal, and Dirk was now six years old. This was the age one could join elementary school, so he was preparing himself for a new routine of education. Rita was very excited about not only starting a new year, but being able to go to school with Dirk. However, he wasn't nearly as thrilled as her. I can't believe I have to go to a kindergarten. Dirk sighed in his mind. He knew he was technically young, but this whole school thing was going to push him to the limit in terms of what he wanted to deal with mentally. The thought of being among droves of children was not thrilling in the slightest. Plus, it would be so different from what he knew. When I was six, I was taken from the slums to the facility to start training. Every day we did drills, ate, slept, and repeated. Although they did educate us, it sure as hell wasn't like a normal school. Dirk remembered his old life. His education was strict and to the point, focusing on the most efficient insertion of information into each child's mind. After a while, it became one of the standard drills they did every day, except instead of a physical workout, it was mental. Now though, he would be going to an ordinary school. This school didn't even teach magic, although they taught about the concept of magic. There, he would be learning about basic knowledge and life skills. Things like reading, writing, geography, history, and math. With Dirk's mental age though, he obviously didn't need to learn all that stuff. While he did want to know the history and geography of the world, that was something he could just pick up a book and read about. His father didn't give any of that to him though, so he was stuck having to go to the school to learn all that. Worst part was, school lasted four years until you were ten. This fact was not appealing to Dirk at all. Oh well. I've gotten past six years of boredom so far. I can last four more. Besides, at least I won't be completely idle. Dirk smiled a bit as he thought about the plans he had in store for himself. Now that he was six years old, he could start training his body like his previous life. This would finally provide him with something productive to do every day. Hey! What are you thinking about? Rita poked him as he drifted off in thought. He glanced at her before stretching his still waking body. I was just thinking about how boring school is going to be. Hmm, well it can get boring. The work is no fun. 
but now we'll both be there. Hey, maybe we could practice with the dark element when we're there. I recently learned a cool new trick. Look! Excitedly, Rita brought up her palm in between them. After a few moments, a small black wisp appeared. It looked like a small ball of black smoke. Rita then expertly controlled it to fly around her hand. He, see? I've been working on this for almost two weeks. It's hard to do at first because it takes concentration. But once you get that down, it's super easy. Saying that, Rita dispersed the wisp of dark energy and smiled proudly. Dirk just looked at her and smiled a bit. Rita was sort of a genius when it came to the dark element, and she attempted to teach him all the little tricks she came up with. It was cute, and he enjoyed her coming to him with these fun little things to do. It was a nice way to pass time and bond. I'll make sure to work hard. Good. With me teaching you, I think you can learn this in two weeks too. Dirk. Rita. Breakfast. Suddenly, a shout was heard throughout the house. It was their mother, Cecilia. Oh. I need to change. Remembering she was in her gown, Rita hopped off Dirk's bed and rushed out back to her room. Dirk also got up and changed, making himself presentable for breakfast. We're going to stop by the academy before heading to the elementary school, okay? Cecilia spoke as she, Dirk, Rita, and Ethan finished eating breakfast. Dirk's father, Riker, was already out at his job as he usually was in the morning. Viola was also gone. Rita spoke up confusedly. Why are we going to the academy? Because I'm going to be joining today. Suddenly, Ethan answered her question with a loud and proud voice. All of you join the academy when you're twelve, and that time has come for Ethan. Today is also the day that he enters. We're going to be meeting with your father and sister there, and once that's settled we'll go to the elementary school. Okay. Now go get changed. Semi-formal. Waving off her kids, Cecilia had them go get dressed. Thirty minutes later, everyone was back down in the manor hall, dressed in semi-formal clothing. It wasn't so fancy as to make them look like royalty but it did have a certain quality to it that made it more outstanding than the ordinary clothes they would wear day to day. All right. Everyone into the carriage. Are we flying? No. Ah. Rita pouted hearing her mother. Dirk was also a little disappointed. It really was fun riding in a flying carriage, but it wasn't something their parents let them do all the time. Walking out of the house, the four quickly jumped into the spacious carriage and set off. The carriage was controlled by a man who sat in the front driver's seat and drove it with magic, not unlike a limousine. The carriage was quickly going decently high speeds down the road and out of the Marquis neighborhood. Then, they entered the main city. Although Dirk had been outside before, it was only to go to the Duke's house and he still hadn't gotten a large grasp on the development level of this empire. In their house, he was able to get some idea. The stoves used for cooking had some kind of magic device inside of it that could generate heat, albeit the maids liked to ignite their own flames to kickstart the stove. For baths, each child had their own and water would be created with another magic device. Then, there was the carriage, which could fly using a magical wind device. While this place didn't have a high level of standard technology, it did have a high level of development, just in the form of magical items. The technology was built around magic, and this world seems to have gotten a good grasp on it. Of course, that was from his perspective as the son of an elite, but the general populace shouldn't be that far off. And upon entering the main city for the first time, Dirk saw that he was about spot on. The city had main roads for carriages and sidewalks for people. There were many carriages just like the one they were in going up and down designated lanes. If each carriage was replaced with the standard car that Dirk knew, he would think this was a modern city. Then there were the bustling sidewalks that hundreds of people walked on. All of their clothing was rather decent, and although they hadn't yet created elastic clothing, there was the clothing that Dirk had discovered when he was younger that could fasten itself with magic. It looked like people lived rather well. Restaurants, bars, butcher shops, clothing stores, alchemy shops 
blacksmiths, libraries, even some areas that carriages would park themselves in and get their magic devices recharged or replaced. Looking around and absorbing the sights, Derp came to the conclusion that while this city wasn't as modern as Earth in terms of development, it definitely wasn't poor or primitive. This city had its own type of magical modernity, and everyone here seemed to be doing very well. The carriage ride lasted a bit less than 20 minutes, after which they came upon a large plaza. All right, we're here. Let's find your father. Dirk's mother stepped out, as did the other children. Upon leaving the carriage, Dirk looked around. The plaza they were in was exceptionally busy. There were thousands of people that hung around the area, mainly families with their excited children. There were also many people dressed in robes like wizards. Then, there was the building that this plaza was outside of. Dirk looked up and scanned the tall, extravagant structure that looked like a castle. There were giant gates that led inside, and Dirk likened this place to some kind of massive, gated college campus. The gates and the walls extended out for hundreds of meters, meaning this place took up a lot of space. That was a given though considering the huge building that was bigger than a university building. Cecilia Suddenly, Dirk's mother was called out from within the bustling crowd. Looking to the voice, Dirk, Rita, and Ethan saw their father along with their oldest sister, Viola. Chapter 7 Hybrid Slash School Viola and Riker quickly walked over from within the bustling crowds. As they did, Dirk sized up his oldest sister. As the oldest, Viola was the first one who went to the Magic Academy. She had been there for two years now and was 14 years old. During that time, nobody in the family except the parents would see her since she was always on campus and doing whatever she did within there. Seeing her now after two years, Dirk was able to see a rather significant difference. Viola was going down the warrior path, someone who fought primarily with weapons like swords instead of with magic like a mage. Two years ago, while she was naturally cold and aggressive, she was still young and immature. The small amounts of training she did naturally wasn't much. Now, however, she felt sharper. Dirk could sense a vastly different demeanor. He could feel her confidence, and the way she carried herself indicated conditioning and skill. Whatever she did in the academy, it had been good for her and her advancement down the path of a warrior. She was starting to shape up like one. Of course, the aura that came off of her was still that of a 14-year-old's. Dirk knew that no matter what, she was only beginning to walk her path, and her experience was still lacking. Though, he still was a bit surprised. When he looked at her and picked up on the subconscious confidence that stemmed from one's capability for physical confrontation, he started to remember some of the super-soldiers from his past life. While he had been ahead of the curve in his program and was running operations at only 13, others were still very capable of violence and holding their own. Viola was beginning to match that of the young super-soldiers he remembered. Somewhat at least. She wasn't as broken and rigid as the super-soldiers, and that wasn't a bad thing, though it meant she wouldn't have the ruthless acuity they would have. So the run is going to be joining me now, huh? Viola spoke as she looked at Ethan, a half-smile on her face. It was hard to tell whether or not she was happy to have a family member joining her or regretful that it was him. Maybe both. Hey! Who are you calling a runt? Don't get cocky just because you have some fancy education now. You think I haven't gotten stronger in the past two years? Mph, I don't care what you've done. I bet you can't even touch me. Is that a challenge? If you dare take it, you runt. All right, you too. That's enough. Riker stepped in before his children started fighting in a public space and shook his head, sighing about the fact that the first thing they did when meeting after so long is argue. Some things never change. Like two peas in a pod. Anyway, Ethan, after today you're going to be under the jurisdiction of the Magic Academy, and you likely won't be seeing home for a long time. I've pretty much taken care of everything, and all there is to do is get you situated. Understood? All right. Good. Today is the opening ceremony and it starts in an hour or so, so let's get going. Say goodbye to your mother and siblings, you won't be seeing them for a while. Okay. 
nodding, Ethan went and gave his mother a hug. Then came Rita, and then Dirk. Though, instead of a hug, Dirk just held out his hand, not interested in giving him a hug. Ethan was also totally fine with this and shook his hand, not wishing to make it awkward. All right. Come with me. Let's get you properly dressed. Okay. With an excited shout, Ethan went on to follow his father and sister. He could hardly wait to start his new life at the academy. The three watched as they disappeared in the crowds, entering the gates of the academy. Cecilia then sighed. Well, I can imagine that the house will be much quieter now. Let's go, you two. We have our own opening ceremony to catch. Yay! It's just you and me now, Dirk. We're gonna have lots of fun. Rita cheered and wrapped up Dirk in a bear hug from behind, looking forward to the many days of fun ahead. Dirk was expressionless though as her pitch black hair got in his face. He still wasn't thrilled about going to a grade school. I'd be nice if I could go to that academy. Seems more up my alley. He sighed. He was only six, and it would be another long six years before he could join. There was nothing he could do, so he just decided to enjoy his genius sister and plan workouts in his head for later. After another carriage ride, Dirk, his sister, and his mother arrived at the grade school. When they did, they could immediately see tons of little kids and their own parents walking into the grounds. This grade school was obviously much smaller than the academy, though it still held tons of children. Apparently, this was also one of the best schools in the city. Though, Dirk wasn't sure how amazing a school for a bunch of kids could be. After parking their carriage in an actual parking lot, the three were soon walking into the grounds of the academy. As they did, they came across lots of different classrooms with colorful signs and various pieces of art along the walls. It was flowery and childish, two things that instantly turned Dirk off to the place. However, there was one thing that he quickly discovered. Not all of the children and people were humans. He had realized that there were other intelligent species in this world when he learned about his father's and sister's elven natures. Even then though, he had only really seen humans and the only out-of-place thing around him was Rita's pointed ears. Now though, his horizons were broadened. Although they were sparse, Dirk could see several people who had fantastical features. There was one family of tall elves who had gold and green hair as well as pointed ears. A couple families were humanoids with the fluffy tails of a tiger or wolf as well as ears on their head and claws on their fingers. Finally, there was a single family of short people, the father and mother of which were five foot and four foot tall respectively. In that family, Dirk was surprised to see that the child, a boy, already had some facial hair while the dad had a massive beard going down to his waist. It looked odd. Mother, those people over there. Dirk tugged on his mother's sleeve and gestured to the humanoids, not sure what to make of such odd creatures. Seeing her son's confusion, she kneeled down to his height and explained. This is something you'll learn in school. Humans aren't the only races. There are other races, for example, those short people over there are called dwarves. Those people with pointed ears are elves like your father. And those people with tails and ears are called hybrids. There aren't a lot of them in this city, but they do have their own empires in other places. Now, I'm not too worried about you doing this, but I'll say it anyway. Don't look down on them, alright? There are lots of people who treat them differently, but you're not one of those people. Treat them normally. Understood? Yes, mother. Good. And don't stand by if someone is getting picked on. You're a good boy, so be good to those around you. Now, let's go visit your guys' classrooms. After lovingly ruffling his hair, Dirk's mother stood back up and led him and Rita to a classroom. For the next few hours, the three went throughout the school. First, they visited Dirk's future classroom. The teacher there had worked at the school for a long time and was a nice and patient old man, something you'd need to be to deal with children for so long. The classroom was also filled with various small projects the previous class did throughout the year. Seeing the miniature zoos full of crudely made wooden animals and dozens of paintings of only God knew what was not thrilling to Dirk, since he knew he would be doing those projects soon as well. 
He had already made his peace with his new life though, so he just sighed inwardly. While they were there, Dirk also saw some of his future classmates. Turns out, the boy who was already growing facial hair was in his year, along with two hybrids. One of the hybrids was a boy who had the tail and ears of a tiger as well as eyes that were vertical slits like a cat's. The other hybrid was, a deer? Dirk looked weirdly at the other timid hybrid, a girl who had what looked like antlers sprouting out both sides of her forehead. They were still only small nubs, but after close inspection, they were definitely antlers. As Dirk stared at the girl, she was beside her parents looking around at everyone as if she were paranoid. However, as if she sensed his gaze, the girl turned to him, and they locked eyes. Dirk didn't seem to care that they were looking directly at each other though and just kept staring at the odd little antlers as well as the girl's brown hair. The concept of hybrids was new to him, so he was processing in his head how the additional body parts like tails or antlers would work. Did the antlers attach to the skull? Would they grow really big? He looked at the parents, and after seeing their large antlers that looked just like a deer's, he answered his second question. He then kept staring at the girl, wondering what she would look like with big antlers. The girl though started to cower under his gaze. At first, she just tried to ignore it, but as he kept blatantly staring for an extended period of time, her face reddened and she shuffled behind her parents, breaking line of sight. Hey! Are you smitten with that girl or something? Suddenly, a voice came from behind him, snapping Dirk out of his focus. He turned to see Rita looking at him with squinted, judging eyes. He shook his head in response. No, I am not smitten. That girl had antlers. So? I've never seen antlers on a person before. It was odd and I wondered how they worked. So you just stared at her? For that long? Ah, uh, I guess. Seeing how innocent her brother was being, Rita went quiet. She then shook her head and spoke. Sigh, I have much to teach you, Dirk. Don't stare at people. It's weird, especially when you stare at girls. Okay? All right? Good. What are you two talking about? As Rita nodded in satisfaction, their mother turned and spoke to them. She had been talking to another parent, so she hadn't seen what happened. I was teaching Dirk social skills. Really? What for? He was staring at a girl. Oh? She was a hybrid with antlers. I thought it was odd, and I accidentally stared for too long. Dirk clarified for his sister before she could lead their mother down a road of misunderstanding. Hearing him, Cecilia nodded. I see. That deer hybrid over there? Yes. Hmm. Those are a fairly rare hybrid race. Deer have a talent for psychokinesis and light mental magic. Looks like that girl has somewhat of a talent since she looks so paranoid. Why would being paranoid signify talent? It has to do with their mental magic. If you had dozens of voices or sounds appearing in your head at random times, I'm sure you would be scared as well. It helps when they concentrate though. Why don't we go talk to them? Come on. Putting her hand on Dirk's back, Cecilia led him toward the deer hybrids. The parents of the girl noticed their approach and greeted them. The father was a tall man who towered over Dirk's mother, and the majestic antlers only added to the height, making it so he almost reached the roof of the classroom. The mother was shorter but still tall, several inches over Cecilia by head, and a foot including the antlers. After giving their greetings, Cecilia gestured to Dirk. I believe my son here is going to be in the same class as your daughter. He was actually interested in the antlers since he's never seen them before. Is that right? Well how do you do, little one? What's your name? Hearing Cecilia, the father dear smiled and squatted down in front of Dirk. Dirk activated his almost instinctual greeting procedure and gave his name. My name is Dirk, sir. Nice to meet you. Well Dirk, it's mighty nice to meet you too. This here is my daughter, Ava. She's a bit shy, but I'm sure she can come say hi to you. The father motioned his daughter over as he spoke in a cool tone, prompting her to timidly come out from behind him while looking down at the floor. Hi. 
Ava softly spoke, and with the surrounding chatter, Dirk could barely pick up on her. He did though, and he gave a proper greeting to her too. Nice to meet you, Ava. Hmm. Ava nodded while glancing up at him. At first, she couldn't really make eye contact, but as she looked at him more, her timidness seemed to go away. Both of them looked at each other, Dirk looking at her antlers, and her looking into his eyes. You're quiet. Quiet. Dirk tilted his head at her mumble. Sure he didn't speak much, only when necessary, but it wasn't like she knew that. Was she just blurting out words? It didn't seem like that though. As she looked at him more, her gaze became more concentrated and focused. Now, Dirk was the one starting to feel uncomfortable. All right Ava, don't start poking into him too much. Oh. Sorry. Hearing her father, Ava realized her mistake and pulled back, turning her head away. Her previously timid and embarrassed demeanor returned. She's still adjusting to her powers, so she's still a bit shy. The father spoke, chuckling at his timid daughter. Cecilia nodded. Looks like it. Has she recently awakened them? Indeed. Do you have experience with deer? A bit. I've been to the Unity Empire a few times. I see. Well, it will probably take a month or two in school for her to adjust. I'm sure she'll get through it just fine. In fact, Dirk, why don't you be Ava's first friend? If you see her at school, be sure to say hi. Understood. Dirk nodded to his mother, accepting whatever requests she gave him. The father dear smiled. I appreciate it young man. You too Ava. Make sure to say hi to Dirk when you see him. Ava, who was still silently hiding behind her parents, slightly nodded her head. Seeing her so scared, Dirk was curious. How can she be so timid? Is she supposed to function like that in school? I do not understand. He shook his head inwardly. After conversing for a bit more, Dirk, Rita, and his mother left the classroom and walked around the school more. When they did, they went to go see a large playground, Rita's new classroom, some of her friends, and other various facilities. This took up a few more hours, after which the three left the school and went back home. For the rest of that day, they didn't do much except prepare themselves for school which started the next day. That night, Dirk went to sleep only after mentally preparing himself for the days ahead. He truly didn't know what to expect, except for childish projects and hopefully, the discovery of some valuable knowledge. Chapter 8, Books It's time for school. Time for school. Hmm. Dirk's eyes shot open as Rita burst into his room. After stopping himself from reflexively jumping out of bed to attention, he looked over to see Rita looking at him excitedly. Are you ready? Yes. Dirk nodded as he took a deep breath and slid out from under his covers. Rita was starting to become his alarm clock. After straightening the sheets on his bed, he walked to the washroom and cleaned himself up before dressing for the day. At the same time, Rita went and laid on his bed, still tired from waking up. Where's that excitement from before? Let's go eat. Dirk spoke as he grabbed his sister's arm, pulling her off the bed before she went back to sleep. She groaned and moved to hug him from behind, using his shoulders to prop herself up. Like that, the two walked to the dining room where food was prepared and their mother was already sitting. Dirk sat his sister down onto her seat before sitting himself and digging into the already prepared food. Are you ready for school today, Dirk? Cecilia asked as he ate. Hearing her, he nodded. Yes, I am. That's good. School starts at 9 a.m. every day, just so you know. Understood. Also, your lunch meals will be given to you there at the cafeteria. You'll be given books and a bag as well for studying. Ugh, I don't like studying. Rita groaned when she heard that. Suddenly, she wasn't feeling so excited about going back to school. Don't start complaining now. You've got another two years ahead of you before you leave. Besides, do you think things are easier at the academy? At least they practice magic there. All we do at the grade school is learn math and history and spelling. It's boring. 
It's boring, but it's easy. Enjoy it while you're their child. Once you get to the academy, things won't be so nice. Now, let's finish and head out. It takes 15 minutes to get there. Soon, the family finished eating and boarded the carriage to leave. Dirk looked out the window as they passed through the bustling city, seeing all kinds of people doing all kinds of different things. Then, they arrived at the school where there was a long line of carriages dropping off children as well as a full parking lot. I still can't believe they actually have parking lots. This place is more modern than I though. Dirk sighed as their carriage entered the line. After pulling up to the front of the school grounds, the door opened. All right you two. Have a good day at school. Rita, take care of your brother. Okay. And Dirk, have a good first day. Yes, mother. Such a stoic. Love you. Cecilia smiled and gave Dirk a kiss on the forehead. Then after saying bye to Rita, the two siblings jumped out of the carriage. Come on Dirk. I'll take you to class. Rita grabbed his hand as she said that, and the two walked with the other children into the school. Soon, they were coming up on Dirk's classroom where several other children were either saying goodbye or crying to their parents. One of them was actually the dear girl named Ava whose parents Dirk quickly spotted due to their tall antlers. Ava was looking at the classroom, clearly hesitant to go inside by herself. Hey Dirk, it's your friend. Do you want to say hi? Rita spotted Ava as well and asked. Dirk nodded, and they approached the family. Well look who it is. Look Ava, it's Dirk. Seeing them approach, the father excitedly turned Ava's attention to them. She looked over and saw Dirk and Rita. Hello sir. Hello Ava. Dirk greeted them, and Ava nodded to him. Hi. It's good to see you Dirk. Hey, you wouldn't mind accompanying Ava here to her seat, would you? She's a bit hesitant to go inside. I can do that. Thank you. You hear that, Ava? Why don't you go with Dirk? All right. Ha, ah, that's my girl. Don't worry. You'll get used to things quicker than you think. The father bent down and gave his daughter a hug, as did the mother. Ava then walked over to Dirk. All right then, Dirk. I'm gonna go to my classroom. Okay. Keep an eye out for me at lunch too. I'll be looking for you. Understood. Then see ya. Rita spoke as she walked away, heading to another part of the school. Dirk then looked at Ava, who was just standing there next to him quietly. Uh, follow me. Okay. Ava nodded, and Dirk walked into the classroom. All right, everyone. Pick out any seat you like and sit. Class starts in ten minutes. When the two walked in, they were greeted with a chattery class full of kids and the nice old man who attempted to wrangle some of them in, guiding them to the rows of tables that could seat five kids each. Not caring about the rambunctious children, Dirk walked over to a seat in the back of the class with Ava in tow. He then sat her down in the corner while he took the seat next to her. Sit there. Ava just nodded at his directions and pulled out the chair. Dirk also took a seat, patiently waiting for class to start while observing the kids around them. As he looked around, he could see that many of the kids seemed to already know each other as they came together and talked in groups. As the teacher urged them to sit, they also took tables for themselves. The boys tended to group up with other boys, and vice versa for the girls. Ding, ding, ding. Eventually, a bell tolled, and things started to quiet down. All right. Class has officially begun. For those of you who don't have a seat yet, just find an open one and take it. The old man announced, and the wandering children quickly found themselves a seat. Dirk watched as a few kids took the three seats next to him, two boys and one girl. Ah, uh, hello. Hi. When a boy sat next to Dirk, he waved and held out his hand awkwardly. Dirk looked at him and shook the hand, giving his own greeting. Okay class. My name is Mr. Drake, and I'll be your teacher for the year. The seats are all filled, so it looks like everyone is here. I'm going to call out your names. Say here when I call you. Ava. 
The teacher called out the first name, but no response was heard. Dirk almost laughed at the irony of the most timid girl getting called on first. It was quite unfortunate. H here. Ava spoke next to him nearly inaudibly. Everyone seemed to hear it though and looked over, prompting the girl to cower in her seat. The teacher just nodded before simply checking off her name and moving on to the next. Brea. Here. Bruce. Here. Casper. Here. The teacher called out everyone's names in alphabetical order. Dirk spoke when his name was called relaxedly before waiting for roll to be taken. Once he had checked off all the names, he put the sheet away and turned to the class. All right. Now, today we don't have anything other than getting you all familiar with how things work around here. All of you are going to be receiving three books. One for language, math, and writing. We will be using these books throughout the year, so don't damage them and always keep track of where they are. Now, all the books are stacked up in those cabinets over there. When I call your name, go over and grab a book out of each cabinet. The teacher spoke, and all the kids in their seats awaited eagerly for their names to be called. Very quickly, the first five students were called, and they walked over to the open cabinets where there were stacks of books. They followed instructions and took one from each cabinet, coming out with three books. Unfortunately, since Ava was the first name on the list, she went up first. She was exceptionally awkward and even ended up stumbling and dropping all her books toward the end. Several kids giggled before she scooped everything back up and hurried to her seat, putting the books in front of her and hiding behind them. Dirk shook his head at the sight. He couldn't fathom how a person could be so paranoid and self-conscious. These were children. Did she really think they would remember this forever? Or that they even cared? While pondering, Dirk was called, and he got up alongside another four kids who made a line to grab the books. However, Dirk had a bit of a mean look on his face. He was not pleased. Language, math, and writing. That's it? No history or geography. This year is not going to be pleasant. He shook his head as he grabbed one of each book, returning to his seat without drawing much attention. While Dirk didn't know how to read or write, that could be learned quickly. He wouldn't need more than a couple months to do so. As for math, unless this world had some convoluted system, he was already a master. Given all that, once he got past the basics for writing and such, he wouldn't have anything more to learn. He immediately knew that this year was going to be a long and drawn-out one. Though, when he thought about Rita, his spirits perked up a bit. He remembered that she was in her third year, and some of her books might talk about the things he wanted to know. He wasn't worried about her withholding her books, so he could have them in his hands whenever she first brought them home. I definitely need to ask her. Mm, such a good sister, she is. Dirk smiled as he pulled over his books, taking off the top one which was his language book. The book looked standard, although it was worn around the edges. Such was expected though. The covers were only leather, and the pages weren't the standard white that he was used to from Earth. These were more parchment, albeit it didn't make reading any harder. The printing business in this world seemed developed enough. Flipping through the pages like a curious kid, he had his AI scan and document each page in its entirety. Documenting things was one of the basic functions of his AI. There were dozens of operations he ran on Earth where he needed to either pull data from a computer, record audio, skin papers, or take pictures. Okay class. Today we're not going to pry into our books. I want everyone to prepare to head outside. We're going to take a tour, discuss your daily schedule, and get to know each other. First I will assign everyone a number based on alphabetical order, and then we will head outside. Okay, Ava. You are number one. Brea is number two. The teacher started the day when everyone had gotten their books. Dirk closed his book and listened. His class had around 40 kids in it, so everyone was numbered one to 40. After that was done, the teacher stood them up and led them out of the classroom. They then did as the teacher said, taking a tour of all the facilities and looking at every corner of the school. A map was created in Dirk's head as they did so. 
It wasn't long though before a bell rang with three deep rings. The teacher had led the class back to the room by this time, and he let them know what was happening. That's the recess bell. When that rings, you all can either go out to the field and play or go to the cafeteria and eat some snacks, or both. When the bell rings again though, everyone needs to come back. Staff will go out and hunt you down if you don't, so be sure to follow the rules and be on time. All right, that's all. Everyone can head outside. With that, the teacher pointed to the door. All the students got up and convened in groups before heading out the door, running to the field that they had seen only a few minutes ago during the tour. Dirk also went out, and Ava stuck to him like glue, not wishing to be on her own in an unfamiliar place. Dirk didn't mind as he followed the crowd of bustling kids to the field. He remembered the place well. Soon, he was out in the clearing. The field was located to the side of the school, and it was as large as a football field. Around it were various containers full of toys and objects for games, as well as a large playground. The playground had a couple stories to it and covered a couple dozen square meters of ground. Dirk was impressed by its size. It was bigger than entire houses. He didn't intend to play on it though. He remembered that Rita would look for him, so he stuck to an open area while looking around. Ava just stood behind him while observing all the kids around them. With only four classes in the whole school, there were only around 160 kids, so all this space for them was more than enough. Dirk! Suddenly, Dirk heard a shout and turned around. He saw Rita prancing over with two other girls in tow. He tilted his head as he observed them. One was blonde and about Rita's height, an average kid. The other was actually a hybrid though. This girl seemed to be a tiger, with round fluffy ears and a slim striped tail. Her hair was orange with black streaks, and her eyes were round and amber. Dirk could immediately feel her wild nature as she looked at him with fighting spirit. Hi Rita. Hey! And hi Ava. These two are my friends, Eden and Tess. Rita pointed to the blonde girl, Eden, and the tiger girl, Tess. Dirk nodded to them before Rita spoke again. Hey, do you want to play? Not particularly. Hmm, there are a lot of kids on the playground. How about we go grab the disc and play? Yeah. Let's go play with the disc. Tess, the tiger girl, beamed at the idea before dashing off to one of the bins. Dirk watched questioningly. Disc? Yeah. Come on. Rita grabbed his arm and yanked him as they started running. Ava was left there standing as she watched them go. Luckily, Dirk turned to her as he ran, waving her over. She looked around her before ducking her head and jogging off. I got it. Throw it here. Eden shouted as she ran to an open area on the field. Tess threw the disc she had just retrieved from the bin, and Dirk caught a glimpse of it. It was a frisbee. The frisbee sailed across the air before Eden jumped up and caught it. Rita let go of Dirk's hand and then sprinted off in another direction, waving for Eden who threw it to her. Got it. Hey Dirk. Go long. Rita shouted to him. Dirk pondered for a second before shaking his head, dipping down and breaking off in a sprint away from her. She threw it, but the throw was off and he had to divert away. Jump. Rita squealed as Dirk ran to intercept. Once he got close, he dove and caught it before it hit the ground. Oof! Yay! Good job! Rita cheered as Dirk stood up, dusting off the grass and dirt from his shirt. He quickly ascertained that his clothes weren't meant for this type of play seeing as his nice vest got scuffed from the landing. He would have to start wearing his cheaper clothes. Well, at least this physical activity is good for my body. Dirk shrugged with the disc in hand. He looked around and saw Ava walking over to him. Wanna go? Dirk spoke as he pointed the disc toward another direction, implying that she should run so he could throw it. She shook her head though. It's okay. All right then. He didn't force it and turned back around, throwing the disc toward Tess. He chucked it with surprising force but not much accuracy, and Tess ended up chasing it down like him. She seemed to enjoy it though, 
not hesitating to dive just like him and get dirty. Like that, the four formed a circuit as they threw it from one to the other. All the while Ava just stood near him and watched. This lasted up until they heard the bell, where they finished up and put the disc back. Hey, I'll find you at lunch too. Come to the cafeteria first. We can practice our magic there while we eat. All right. Dirk nodded, after which the two groups separated. Dirk and Ava walked back to their classroom where the teacher went on with discussing how the rest of the year would go. A couple hours later, lunch came, and the pair headed straight for the cafeteria. Surprisingly, most of the other kids went to play first, so it was rather empty. The cafeteria was a building connected to the school full of lunch tables, more than enough for all of the students. There were also the cooks who prepared food for everyone, a set menu being available each day. Dirk decided to hop right into the small line with Ava. Waddle it be, sweetie? One of the ladies behind the counter spoke as she saw Dirk. He looked at the menu, but frowned when he realized he still couldn't read. He asked the lady, and she told him that there were two options for either a meat similar to beef and bread, or something that sounded similar to noodle soup. He immediately chose the meat option, wanting to stuff as many nutrients into his body so his cybernetics and body could develop. After asking Ava, she chose the soup. The two quickly received their trays with all the food loaded on them. There was a surprising amount, which pleased Dirk a lot. It also indicated that the kids of this world tended to eat a lot, something he didn't mind at all. Dirk! You already got food? Pick out a table for us then. Suddenly, Rita appeared with the same two girls. She spoke to him quickly before hopping in line. Dirk walked over to an empty table with Ava before sitting down and digging in. Huh, this tastes just like beef. It's pretty good too. I like the sauce. Dirk smiled when he ate the food. On his tray was a big piece of meat and a slice of bread. The meat was covered in some kind of brown sauce, and he was pleased to taste how good it was. He didn't have any expectations, but was still impressed. This school must be pretty extravagant. Well, Mom said it was one of the best schools in the Empire for kids. I guess this much is called for. Though, I still feel weird about it. Dirk frowned as he thought about where he was. His parents sent him to likely the most expensive school in the Empire. None of the kids here looked poor in the slightest. If someone could send their kids here, then they had to have some kind of status. He felt weird about being here though. He didn't feel deserving of all this. Or rather, he felt out of place in such a nice environment. Was it okay for him to be here? At this point in his life on Earth, he was being beaten into the floor by terrifying drill instructors. He could still remember the batch of kids that were trained alongside him. Since they were only kids, there was not much harassment needed before they could be broken and reformed. Most of the training was a slow process by which they taught you the ways of a killing machine. The first few months were the hardest, but after that everyone got used to it. From there, each child was raised under that environment. Dirk had never even had a name before coming to this world. When he remembered his other life, when he was six, he felt off. Which one was the right way? Surely there were many poor kids out in the empire who lived in slums and didn't get an education. Was it wrong to be in such a nice place? To be such a privileged kid? Was the brutal training the right way? He was at least fed and given valuable knowledge and skills. Or was the way of the poor correct? Should he have gone through a worse school or no school at all? Where was the place he belonged? Dirk couldn't answer this question. He often pondered things like this, brooding over the vast difference between his two lives. He could never seem to get anywhere though. Hey! What are you frowning about? You always look so mean. Start smiling more. Otherwise people won't talk to you. Suddenly, he was spurred from his reverie. Rita came over with her friends and sat down. She had chosen the meat option too. Dirk just shook the thoughts out of his head and looked at his sister as she took a few large bites. Thinking about it, they often ate a lot during dinner at the house. Children did seem to just eat more in this world. Chapter 9, Friends Slash Workout 
Hey, see if you can do the wisp thing. All you need to do is form a ball of darkness above your palm, and then move it around. At the lunch table within the cafeteria, Rita set down her utensils before raising her palm. The next second, a wisp of dark mana appeared, and it proceeded to swirl around her hand and forearm. It then disappeared, and Rita turned her gaze towards Dirk as if beckoning him. Receiving the gaze, Dirk lifted his own palm. Like he usually did, he found a spot of dark mana in the air before poking it, drawing the mana toward him. Other dark mana was then attracted to it, and controlling it all, he formed a ball above his palm. Usually, this is where he stopped, but now he tried to move it. He imagined the ball moving, similar to Rita's. He had to really concentrate though, so he blocked out all other thoughts. His mind became narrow, not unlike when he would get behind a sniper back on earth, and the ball of darkness budged. It slowly rotated around his hand, albeit unsteadily. Once it had done a full orbit though, Dirk frowned and the ball dissipated. Ah! You had it! Nice. Now you just need to keep doing that, and you'll be able to make it fly freely in no time. Rita clapped excitedly at his success while giving advice. Dirk nodded before drawing out more mana from the air, proceeding to rotate it even more. This time, the ball did a full orbit and a half before dissipating. Unfortunately, on the third try, it didn't even make it halfway around. Any further tries of his were unsuccessful in making a full orbit. However, Dirk wasn't unhappy. If anything, he was tired. He found that as he exerted himself to control the ball, he became progressively drained. It wasn't a physical exhaustion though, but mental. His head ached, though that was about the extent of it. It was just his thoughts that became sluggish, and there wasn't much physical detriment to speak of. Don't exert yourself too much. You'll get tired and fall asleep. That would make you vulnerable to an attack. Tess, Rita's friend who sat across from Dirk, stopped chewing her food as she noticed Dirk's exhaustion. Hearing her advice, Dirk nodded rather seriously. Should he be in combat and drain his mental energy like that, he would surely be disadvantaged. While his body was fine, the mind was still needed in order to move it well. At least, that was until he trained himself and made combat instinctual. He immediately thought about how much he wanted to train. Having such a young and undeveloped body displeased him. It made him feel weak and vulnerable. How could he complete missions with such weakness? Exerting yourself is a great way to train though. When you get tired and recover, your mind becomes stronger and lets you control mana better. That's what my mom said. Rita chimed in after Tess, and Dirk froze in his thoughts. He had indeed heard that from his mother. But to what extent could you train your mind here? On earth, while you could discipline yourself mentally, that didn't translate to very much. Everyone still had a set amount of energy and willpower. Given enough time and exertion, you would collapse. That's why one had to be focused in their thoughts and allocate their energy, especially in drawn-out battles. But now, on this other world, training your mind meant greater control over mana. Dirk had noticed the difference, how his mind was actually sharper than on earth. That meant things were different here, that the mind worked under a different system. Is that what the profile was? Dirk pondered and pulled out his profile. Profile. Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, I. Rank, Zero. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%. Earth 88%, Metal 93%, Dark 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7. This was Dirk's new profile. After the appraisal, his attributes underwent a change. The information from the appraisal changed his profile to match, and now he could see his affinities. Another indicator was also added to it, called rank. Tiers represented your mana level, according to Dirk's father. The higher the tier, the better your control over mana and the more you could store. Ranks represented the same, but for anima instead. Anima was the energy used to refine your body. 
the more you refined your body, the higher your rank, and the higher your strength. Both indicators counted using numerals, and each numeral had three stages. The lowest stage was represented by a minus, and the highest stage a plus. Then, there were his traits and skills. The skill AI interface was labeled at grade 7, but Dirk wasn't really sure what that meant. He didn't ask his parents either, since he wasn't sure if he should even have a skill or traits. He knew he wasn't exactly a normal case. Dirk looked at his tear which stood at I-dash. He also didn't know if this was any good or not. He hadn't received any information on tiers or ranks and how high they could go. He at least had a gauge though. Until he learned what all that meant, he would just track any progress he made. After draining his mana at the lunch table, Dirk stopped attempting to be as good as his sister and finished eating his food. As he scarfed down the last of his meat, he found that his mana levels were rejuvenated somewhat. Looking at the meat with his magic sense, he could indeed see a bit of mana held within it. It looked like eating these meats were good for his recovery. Can we get seconds? Dirk asked as he stood up. Rita nodded toward him as she put another piece of food in her mouth. Yeah. You can also get thirds. All right. Be right back. Excitedly, Dirk strode over back in the lunch line and got himself another serving. He then sat back down and inhaled everything before going and getting yet another serving. Hungry boy, are we? Here you go handsome. The lunch lady served another thick slice of meat while smiling sweetly. Dirk found himself unconsciously smiling as well seeing how nice this lady was. Soon enough, a bell rang. Rita told him that was the halftime bell signifying the second half of lunch. At that time, over a hundred kids rushed in to come eat, filling up the line in no time. When that happened, Rita and her friends stood up. Come on. We can go play now. Meet us on the field when you're done. Announcing that, they ran out of the cafeteria. Dirk just let them go as he finished the last of his meat, taking a bit of time afterward to digest. His digestive system was stronger than most, capable of absorbing energy from food very quickly. He could feel all the meat being broken down in his stomach by the minute. This was why he wasn't full even after three servings. Did you want any more? Dirk turned to the timid girl next to him. In the time that he was eating and practicing, Ava had cleaned out her soup, and the bowl was basically clean. She shook her head at his question though, prompting him to stand from the table. Okay then. I'm gonna go to the field. You can come with if you want. Standing up, he set his tray above a trash can. Ava quickly mirrored him before the two left the cafeteria. The rest of the day went uneventfully. When school ended, their mother arrived in the carriage for pickup. Dirk saw Ava off before boarding the carriage with Rita, officially ending his first day of school. Seeing Dirk sit next to her, Cecilia ran her fingernail across his forehead, combing back his hair. So? How was your day? Good. Dirk hummed as he enjoyed the sensation of his mother's tender touch. He had come to like the little acts of kinship his mother did, such as this. Hearing his bland response though, Cecilia clicked her tongue. Truly a man of few words. Did you make any friends? No. Dirk shook his head. Upon hearing this though, Rita immediately rebuked him. Ha. Huh. Yeah you did. Ava is your friend. And did you not like Eden and Tess? They were nice. So they're your friends. H.M., not really. Dirk frowned as he thought about it. What were friends to him? Ava was basically declared to be his first friend before school started, and he only knew these other girls for all of two hours. Were they his friends? He didn't know the significance of that word much. Gray could have been considered his friend, but he was more of a father than anything. Sensing Dirk's contemplation, Cecilia reached over and ruffled his hair. If you thought they were cool, then they can be your friends. It's not bad to be on good terms with lots of people. Did you enjoy playing with them or being around them? It wasn't bad, I guess. Throwing the disc was a bit fun. Alright, that's good. Be sure to make lots of friends. 
maybe when you meet enough people, you can make a couple of blood brothers or sisters. Blood brothers? Yeah, people who you're willing to fight alongside. People who you do everything for. They're more than just friends. Your father is blood brothers with Duke Hillshire. That's why all of you go to him to be appraised. We're very good friends with his family. Dirk pondered Cecilia's statement. He had never really been close with anybody other than Gray. His relations with other people were strictly business. The only time he ever communicated with other people was when he ran operations as part of a team. Anyway, you shouldn't have been assigned any work. You won't be for a while. Do you have your books? In here. Dirk motioned to the bag that he received from the school, simply a wool sack that was fancier than most. Rita also opened hers and pulled out the history, math, science, and world studies books. Seeing them, Dirk almost wanted to snatch them right then and there. They were exactly the books he wanted to see. Good. Don't lose them. I don't want to have to pay for any books like last year. I won't lose them. The last book just disappeared. Rita complained loudly at her mother's jab. Apparently she had lost a book before. Cecilia shook her head. Books don't just get up and walk away. At least, these ones don't. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Dirk looked at his mom weirdly hearing that. Were there books that could actually get up and walk away? What kind of exotic creature would that have to be? Soon, the family arrived back at the house. School ended around 4 p.m. Dirk was pleased to find out a while ago that this world ran on a similar time schedule as Earth. Only, there was one crucial difference than that of Earth. As the family hopped out of the carriage, Dirk looked to the sky. The sun was getting close to setting, and Dirk could see the moons above the pink clouds. There were two moons in the sky. One was dark, and almost black-gray, and one was a bright white. Seeing this had shocked Dirk at first, but he had gradually gotten used to it. It was a cooler sight than the moon of Earth, that was for sure. When they entered the house, the three settled down. Cecilia had a garden of her own in the backyard, so she went back to tending to it as she did many days. Rita also went with her to help since she didn't have anything else to do. She surely didn't want to read her new books. Dirk also wasn't in a rush to get the books. He first wanted to figure out how he would begin training his body. He was now at the age where he had received training on Earth. All the memories of his training days resurfaced in his mind. He wouldn't have to worry about exercises aimed toward discipline. All he needed were the ones aimed at strengthening the body, increasing his endurance and stamina, and refining control over himself. Many of the workouts and drills were derived from martial arts, and most of what they did revolved around those three points. Getting to that point, Dirk determined what he would do. He already knew his martial arts. It was one that was designed to kill or incapacitate your opponent in the most efficient, direct way, no matter your position or situation. Of course, while he had also been taught things like kickboxing, boxing, and jiu-jitsu, those were more supplementary. So, he decided to simply train back up his martial arts. Then, at the same time, he would train his body. Both of these things were the same but also different. It was simple for him though. He already knew plenty of workouts. There were only two problems though. One, he didn't have any weights to lift with. Two, he didn't have any partners to spar with. While these two things weren't absolutely crucial, they would help him out a lot. Just knowing the martial arts was only half the battle. Dirk needed both his mind and body to be trained for the martial art. The two worked in conjunction. If he didn't train himself, he wouldn't have the strength, flexibility, or the reflex he needed to be capable of carrying it out. Should I ask Rita to train with me? Dirk considered it, but he knew she might not want to. Rita didn't have the affinity for anima, so she had never even considered doing anything to train her body, only focusing on her magical parlor tricks. While Dirk would still argue for her training her body, if she was really that opposed, she wouldn't get anything out of it. The only other person he could think of to train with was his mom, but there were many problems with that. For one, he didn't really know how he would explain his knowledge of a systematic martial art. 
Secondly, she was way too big for him. He was still only six years old, so it would be a very awkward fight, especially if he tried to grapple with her. Eventually, Dirk decided that he would ask Rita, but didn't hold any hopes. He then thought about the problem with weights, but decided that he also couldn't do much about that. He decided he would just train his body freely until he could possibly go out and find weights, should they even exist in this world. Maybe he could find some heavy rocks. With that last thought, Dirk went to his room. He devised his workouts for the next week, activating his AI and having it track his progress. His workouts would consist of sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups using the window frame, 10-kilometer runs, many suicide sprints, and other dynamic movements like burpees and side planks. All kids of rigorous workouts were planned, and when he was done, he had three hours of planned exercise every day. Then, since he was in his room, he decided to start right then. He changed out of most of his clothes, appearing from his closet with only fitted cloth shorts. While he was still only six, his cybernetically enhanced body made his muscles already denser than normal. His bones were also stronger, and his blood could be filled with more oxygen, giving him greater stamina. This all added up to a slim but strong body. Interface Status Dirk spoke, giving a basic command that would have the AI evaluate his body similar to when it first booted up. The AI was always keeping track of the changes in his body, so he could ask for this information at any time. Host model. Host age, 6 years. Blood type, AB+. Skeletal structure, organic iron composite, developing. Muscle structure, high power compacted fibers, developing. Sensory organs, high density receptors, developing. Self-replicating nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems, offline. Final stand weapon system, offline. Overdrive systems, offline. Current bodily state, slighty combat capable, 100% healthy, developing. Warning. Unable to construct nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems. Insufficient chemical energy production. Warning. Unable to construct final stand weapon system. Insufficient chemical energy production. Insufficient mineral reserves. Warning. Unable to activate overdrive. Insufficient chemical energy production. Intelligence systems fully functional. Awaiting host orders. Dirk looked through everything and nodded. While he was still developing, that was natural. He was still a growing boy after all. He often checked this status before doing any activity just to be sure nothing was off. All right. Maximum effort. Saying that, Dirk popped down to the floor and started his push-ups. He knocked out 30 before flipping over onto his back and immediately starting his sit-ups. Once he did 50 of those, he moved straight onto his next set. His workouts only had a single break for seven minutes after each hour. Toward the end of his life on Earth, he would work out for five hours straight. It was the only way for him to fully exert himself. Now, he was beginning to push himself back to that standard. He didn't care that this body didn't have nearly as much stamina. And sure enough, as he expected, after only 15 minutes he already felt like vomiting. He didn't stop though. It was only when he was on the verge that he finally ran to the bathroom and puked. Only moments later though, he was back on the floor doing his work despite the continuous churning of his stomach and burning of his muscles. He constantly gasped for air, and a puddle of sweat quickly formed at the spot he did his work at. He felt bad because it was on carpet, but if need be he would clean it himself. Soon, the first hour passed, and Dirk collapsed to the floor after completing his last set. His arms, chest, core, shoulders, and legs hurt. Actually, there wasn't a single part of him that didn't hurt. Even if he were to stop here, he would definitely be sore tomorrow. This was especially so since he didn't currently have his nano-repair systems that could repair his body. But he didn't. After five minutes of gasping, Dirk forced himself to his feet and went over to the windows. He struggled to unlatch them and push them up, but after he did a nice breeze blew in, cooling his body. 
he basked in the sunset and cool winds for two minutes before pulling himself away and beginning his next hour. By now, there was practically nothing in his stomach, and he never felt like vomiting anymore. His body was too tired to do so. He just pushed himself to carry out his workouts. Unfortunately, by the end of the second hour, his body couldn't quite handle it anymore and started giving out. Dirk frowned as this happened more and more. Looks like I'm pushing myself too much. This body can't keep up yet. Oh well. Dirk decided to stop there. He didn't want to hurt himself, and he didn't have any reason to rush. If he could only do two hours of work, then so be it. He would just have to slowly build up from there. With that, he decided to just rest as much as he could. He could feel his heart beating at a million miles per hour, and the pulses of blood could be felt through his head. The lactic acid was building up in his body, making his muscles stiff and feel like they were on fire. Knowing that he would tighten up if he stayed still, he stood up and did some light movements and stretches. Each movement felt labored, but after a while he was able to keep himself flexible. He also slowed his breathing down, controlling his heart rate and by extension his body's recovery. Dirk! Dinner! Suddenly, a voice was heard from his door. Rita shouted as she entered, but when she saw his body covered in sweat, she stopped in confusion. What in the world are you doing? Chapter 10, Supernatural I was training. Dirk wiped some sweat out of his eye as Rita stared at him weirdly. Why? Because. Duke Hillshire said I shouldn't neglect training. I want to make my muscles stronger. After thinking for a split second, Dirk gave her that reason. He didn't need to say much else. The excuse of listening to the Duke would probably be enough for both her and his parents to accept his odd behavior. Rita nodded. Oh, all right. Actually, I was going to ask you something. Would you like to train with me? I know you don't have an affinity for anima, but it isn't good to have a weak body. We can learn to fight and defend ourselves. Hmm. Rita went silent and crossed her arms, resting her chin upon her hand. She had also heard what the Duke said when they were at his residence last. Even their father, who was only a mage, trained his body sometimes. No matter what, training was good for you. Rita knew this. At least, Dirk thought she did. I don't know. Training is hard. Besides, I don't want to look like that. You can barely walk too. Rita shook her head as she watched him struggle over to the bathroom. His muscles were so weak that his steps were labored. That combined with the dripping sweat wasn't exactly good at convincing her. Expecting such a response, Dirk let out a faint sigh before shrugging his shoulders. He couldn't blame his sister for being a kid. Eh, all right. Well, at least think about it. You can either train with me or help mom in the garden. If you want to train with me, just come to my room after school. Okay. Then I'm gonna wash up. Tell mom I'll be down there in ten. Dirk waved, prompting Rita to nod and turn on her heels. He turned on his bathtub as the door clicked shut. Ten minutes later, Dirk was walking down the stairs into the dining room. His mother and sister were already digging in, and his place had a prepared plate of food. Surprisingly, there was a larger portion. So you're training, huh? Cecilia spoke as he emerged. He wasn't sweating anymore, but she could tell that he was weak. He struggled to even get himself into the chair. Dirk didn't show any surprise as he picked up his fork. Yes, mother. I wanted to follow Duke Hillshire's advice and train my body. Hmm, that's good. If you're going to train though, let me teach you. I don't need you hurting yourself trying to figure things out. Okay. Dirk hesitated, but eventually just nodded. He shouldn't even know what training was, let alone how to do it. He had no grounds to reject, so he could only accept despite his unwillingness. I doubt this world knows how to train the body better than Earth. Do they even have an anatomic model of the body? Sigh, oh well. That reminds me, I should get those books from Rita. Dirk exhaled as he resigned himself to fate before remembering the textbooks Rita brought home. 
hearing his assent, Cecilia smiled in satisfaction. Good. If you start training now, you'll be a strong boy come time to enter the academy. And since you want to go down this road, you should stick with it. Mother won't let you quit so easily. I understand. We'll start training after school. Every day except for two rest days. Be sure to get plenty of sleep as well. You need it to heal and recover. Understood. Hmm. Then eat up. I'm sure you're hungry. Cecilia ruffled his hair. The next moment, Dirk felt his stomach cry out for food. There was literally nothing in it, and he felt like he could eat an entire cow. He quickly devoured the slab of juicy meat on his plate, after which a maid brought him another large serving. He went through all of that as well, stuffing himself to his limit before finally setting down his utensils. Strong men eat big meals. Cecilia chuckled seeing him eat so much. When Dirk finished, he was about to turn to Rita to ask to see her books, but then he remembered that he still couldn't read. Damn. I need to learn this language quickly. He huffed inwardly, frustrated. He kept forgetting that he was still only a child, and this was a different world. The night passed as Dirk went to bed early. He had considered waking up early to do his own workout outside of what his mom planned, but he wanted to see what she would have him do first. Who knew, maybe she had a developed method of training. Though, there was also the fact that he could barely move upon waking up. His muscles had been so exhausted that they were stiff as rocks now. It took several minutes just to sit himself up. I miss my little repair bots. He sighed as he struggled to move to the bathroom. He took half an hour to soak in hot water, loosening his muscles, after which he went and clothed himself. By the time he was dressed in normal clothing, breakfast was prepared. He and Rita were soon back at school. Like the day before, Ava wouldn't go into the classroom and waited for him with her parents. When they were sat down, school started, and the teacher began his first lesson. All right class, today we'll be going over the introductions for your books. This year you're going to learn how to read and write, as well as the basics for math. We're first going to start with the alphabet. Now, take out your language book. The teacher directed everyone, and all the kids pulled out their textbooks from their bags. Most kids had left their books at their desks overnight, so nobody forgot anything. The lesson started and went until recess. During the lesson, Dirk learned the alphabet and some pronunciation. He first documented everything with the AI before focusing on memorizing everything. This wasn't his first time learning a language. He had learned several others on Earth, so he knew well the process involved in learning another. Recess came and went, and after another lesson where they learned numerical symbols, lunch came. Dirk focused entirely on eating during lunch. He was hungry and his body needed all the energy and nutrients it could get for recovery. While he had progressively gotten less sore through the day, everything still hurt. This food that had some mana and helped mitigate that. While he ate, he also played with his magic, working on the trick Rita showed him. Since the food had some mana, he decided to drain his mana pool. Even disregarding the extra supply of mana being fed to him, utilizing his mana to its limits was a way to improve himself. He took every opportunity to do so since he didn't have anything better to do. By the end of lunch though, Dirk hadn't made much progress. For some reason, he could never get past more than a revolution and half with the dark ball of wisp. While his control was slightly better, that wasn't enough. It definitely wasn't on par with Rita who could play with it like a toy. He constantly messed up and had to retry, his sister watching his every failure. He didn't mind too much though. He wasn't one to brood over failure. He was taught that, if you failed, you got your ass up and sought to either make it right or ensure that you wouldn't fail again. There was no use for apology or sulking. This mentality made Dirk mostly numb to failure. Especially for things like this, he simply didn't care about failing. He would just give it his best, doing everything in his power to succeed in one way or another. When lunch ended, everyone went back to class for a few more hours. At four o'clock, Dirk's mother was there to pick him and his sister up. She spoke to them on their way back. Rita already knows this, 
but just so you know in the future, I'm not going to be picking you guys up every day. The driver here will be doing so, so don't always expect me. Understood. Dirk nodded in understanding. It was a simple drive to and from the house, so it wasn't like he was going to fret about his mother not being there. She likely had better things to do anyway. After Dirk nodded, Rita raised her hand. Hey mom, can I go and play at Tessa's house? Today? Sure. Okay. We plan to go in an hour. She said I can eat dinner there. As long as you're back before ten. Miss Sanala will go with you too. All right. Rita smiled. Miss Sanala was the head maid of the house, similar to Butler Gordon at the Duke's house. While Dirk didn't have much interaction with her, she often helped the other family members with things like dressing, cleaning, and in general any tasks they needed to get done. The three arrived back at the house, and surprisingly, they entered to see their dad snacking on some fruits in the dining room while reading his book. The book was a very fancy one, and apparently a magical one as well. Even now, Dirk could see mana fluctuating off of it. Their father was often seen reading from it, whenever they did see him. Home early? Cecilia walked up to her husband, exchanging a kiss. No, I'll be heading back out in an hour. Just wanted to check on my kids. So, how's school? Riker turned to Dirk, who simply nodded to him. It was good. I trained my magic with Rita during lunch. Trained your magic? How so? Like this. Rita perked up and raised her hand, creating that wisp and making it fly around her body. She had gotten better at that, the display surprising Dirk. It looked like she hadn't shown him this before so as to not put him to shame. Impressive. Although it's basic, it's amazing that you can do that. What tier are you at? Tier I. I advanced not that long ago. Good job. HM, I guess since you're there, we can teach you chore magic. What's that? Rita tilted her head confusedly, and Riker assumed a lecturing stance. Chore magic is magic that anybody with a modicum of mana can perform. They consist of four extremely basic spells. The first is the water ball, then the breeze spell, then dirt sweeping, and finally the spark spell. All the maids use them every day. Hmm. But I can't use any of those. I only have an affinity for the dark element. Rita spoke with a light bulb moment. Riker chuckled at her. No, you can do it. It's just that you can only use those absolutely basic spells since you only have the dark attribute. Anything more is impossible. Even Dirk can use the breeze and water ball spells even though he has neither the air nor water attribute. However, it takes more energy than normal to cast something that's outside of your affinity. Your mother only has the earth and dark attributes, but she can create a tongue of fire. Indeed. Cecilia nodded and brought up her palm. A spark ignited and turned into a small flame the next second. Dirk's eyes lit up, remembering seeing this spell as a baby when she cooked. Many of the maids used the flame to quickly heat up stoves or ovens for cooking as well. Could he actually use magics of other elements? Dirk activated his senses that could see the man around him, but he could only see the dark, earth, and fire elements, alongside anima. Outside of that, he could only see some other kind of faint fog. There was something there, but it was almost indistinguishable. Did that fog contain the water and air mana? Looking closer, he could indeed see a slight difference among that fog. He could sense moisture from some, and a breeze from others. It was barely noticeable though, and he wasn't sure if he was seeing things wrong or not. Chore magic is really easy once you learn the spell. Everyone knows the spell too. It's no secret. Should we learn it? I can teach you guys the spells before I have to leave. Riker patted Rita's head as he looked toward his wife. She shook her head though. You go ahead and teach Rita the spells. Dirk and I actually have some training to do. Training? Riker was surprised and turned to Dirk. He nodded alongside his mother. Dirk has decided to heed Hillshire's advice and train his body. I didn't want him hurting himself so I'm going to teach and train him. 
Today is our first day. I see. You've chosen to tread a rough path, son. I wish you luck in your endeavors. Riker patted his son's shoulder as if he were going off to war. Cecilia just rolled her eyes though before smacking her husband. I'm not gonna kill him. Just go teach Rita. I can teach Dirk the spells after our training. Sigh, alright. Just let me see my son in one piece when I come home again. If you don't get out of here then you won't be leaving in one piece. Alright then Rita, it's time for our first lesson. Riker chuckled as he pulled his daughter along. Cecilia shot him a glare before turning to her son. Change into lighter clothing and head to the garden. No shoes or shirt. Understood. Dirk nodded before spinning on his heel and heading upstairs. For some reason, he reacted strictly when he heard his mother's commanding tone. He started having flashbacks to boot camp. Since you're only six years old, you obviously won't be capable of amazing feats of strength, but you should have decent stamina. We'll be training everything from your running stamina to your strength and endurance. This involves many things like movements that require you to exert exploding strength and others that require you to exert medium strength over time. I'll also help with your flexibility, an essential trait that will prevent injury and enhance your agility. After Dirk made his way to the garden in his shorts, his mother began briefing him. She had also appeared in activewear, the clothes outlining her strong but slim body. Dirk just stood in place with a rigid at attention stance as she spoke. Nothing she was saying was anything new to him, but that was irrelevant. He silently took in every word she said. Now, I'll show you the workouts you'll be doing. And since you'll be training your body, I guess I might have to go out and buy some potions. We'll see how you do though. For now, just watch me closely. Saying that, Cecilia proceeded to drop to the floor, entering push-up position. She showed him exactly what to do, going so far as to explain the angle his elbows should be at. Then, she flipped over and went into a sit-up position. Dirk was surprised to see many of the same bodyweight workouts from Earth. All the exercises she showed targeted all the muscle groups. While Dirk knew some workouts that were better than the ones she showed, in general, none of her exercises were bad. They would get the job done just as well as his. All right. I don't expect you to remember all that, but at least you have an idea. Now, start with the first exercise. Let me see you do ten. Cecilia flipped herself upright after ending with a handstand exercise. She hadn't even broken a sweat demonstrating everything, and there were plenty of exercises. Dirk had seen and memorized them all though. The only thing he had to get used to was the different names for each one, but otherwise he pretty much knew them all already. Thus, he quickly dropped to the floor and did ten push-ups. He could feel his previously sore muscles hurt under the activation, but he didn't even think about it. Very good. Now the second. Do fifteen. Dirk nodded and flipped over, doing sit-ups. Now the third. Let's see if you remembered them all. Having a good memory is important if you want to practice magic too. Dirk nodded before going on to the next. This went on for nearly thirty different exercises, after which Cecilia was smiling, impressed. Good. I'm surprised you remembered them all. And you were able to do them exactly as I showed you. How do you feel? Tired? I can continue. Dirk spoke after standing up. He was sweating, but this much work couldn't compare to the intense training he did yesterday. He considered it good enough to get his stiff muscles loosened up. All right. You looked a bit shaky on some of those though, so we won't do too much. I don't know what you did yesterday, but I want you to recover before we start tomorrow with the real work. Understood. Dirk answered plainly, but inwardly he was a bit surprised. His mother had a good eye if she was able to see his weakness. His muscles were indeed a bit shaky, but that was only because his body had yet to adapt to any form of training. He thought about the reason she had him work out half naked though and understood. She probably wanted to see where I'm at. Getting a good look at my muscles probably did that. If she saw twitching muscle fibers, then she could figure out that I was struggling. Seems like she knows her stuff. 
Dirk smiled a bit. He didn't mind if his mother trained him. If she was capable, then he would just follow her lead. If there was a day that they didn't do much, then he would just do additional work. He rather enjoyed spending time with her anyway. She was nice. Hmm, hang on. Suddenly thinking of something, Cecilia strode off into the house. That simple action though made Dirk go wide-eyed. Not only were her steps fast, but they covered several meters of ground and were incredibly strong. He could immediately see that his mother had some kind of superhuman strength and speed, though he couldn't understand how that was possible. Just her slim body was capable of bursting with speeds faster than world-class sprinters? In splits of a second, no less? Dirk's mind went into a bit of turmoil, and it didn't help when his mother reappeared with speeds even faster than before. She didn't even create any sound, simply zipping to his side with a light step as her body defied physics. In her hands now appeared a book, in which she quickly wrote several lines. This will be your training manual. Every day gets a page. I will create your workouts and you'll follow them. They aren't difficult, so you won't need me to watch over your every move. I will though for the first week, and every week after that I'll watch you once to ensure that you aren't slacking. Now, here's the workout for today. I'll fill in the rest of the week tonight. Saying that, she stuffed the book into Dirk's hands. He snapped out of his reverie long enough to look at the page, seeing a list of workouts and how many to do. Any questions? How are you able to move so fast? Dirk asked the question he now wanted to know the most. She smiled at him. Oh, sorry. Those were just some movement techniques. Who knows, maybe I'll end up teaching you them should you want to learn. You'll have to get a lot stronger though before you can execute them, so be sure to take your workouts seriously. I will. Dirk nodded blankly. That was a given. But the movement techniques were not. While he didn't have trouble seeing his mother move, it was still incomprehensible for a human to be capable of such instantaneous speed. Just his mother was now faster than any human Dirk had ever seen. He was starting to get a glimpse of just how supernatural this world was. Chapter 11 Spells Slash Dungeons After Dirk got over his shock, he took another look at the book his mother gave him. It looked like a little journal, and he assumed from her words that this would simply be used for logging his workouts. And while he couldn't yet read, she went through each word and made sure he knew the workout associated with that word. Dirk made sure to memorize this information so he didn't need to ask her what the words meant in the future. And since he had his workout, he went and did it. He already logged the page with his AI, so he shut the book, set it down, and got to work. Today was lighter since he had already done each of the different exercises. Cecilia nodded as she watched her son drop to the floor and do the first drill on the list. She had also written down how much rest he should be taking, so from beginning to end, each workout should only take a certain amount of time. And sure enough, regardless of how tired he was, Dirk followed everything to the second. She was very impressed. Not only by his ability to push through the pain, but also his ability to follow directions. He didn't even look at the book a second time after setting it down. Cecilia watched her son do every workout. The only time she turned away was to grab some water for him, bringing him a leather bow to back. This went on for around half an hour, after which Dirk sat himself against the wall of the house while breathing roughly. Because this workout wasn't nearly as intense as yesterday though, he didn't go so far as to feel like vomiting. It was just enough to make his muscles burn. Very good. That'll be all for today. Tomorrow won't be so easy. We're going to gradually build you up through the years. When you enter the academy, you'll have an edge over your peers, both magician and warrior alike. Hmm, that reminds me, we still need to figure out what technique you should be using. Technique? Dirk forced out his question in between breaths. Cecilia was silent for a few seconds before explaining. There are techniques or manuals that we use to develop our magical and physical abilities. While techniques aren't absolutely necessary, they can greatly affect your development. Viola has one, as does Ethan. Rita is about to receive hers, and once you become ten years old, you will also choose yours. 
at that time we will take you to the Duke. The only problem is that there are quite a few options. You will also be choosing two manuals since you are capable of body refining and magic. Of course, that is unless you absolutely don't wish to go down one of those paths. I understand. Dirk went into thought, though not about whether he was going to travel down both paths. He never even considered dropping one. There was no need to. What he thought about were these manuals, or techniques. How good were they? Why can't I receive a manual now? Dirk asked this question after pondering a bit. He didn't understand why he could only get the technique at ten years old. Was there some age restriction? Was it not good to start developing himself early on? The reason none of you children receive any training until you enter the academy at twelve years old, is because it can be very dangerous. Just like your body, your mind and soul need to develop before they can be properly used. If you force a child to train magic or body refinement, it can result in stunted growth, injury, disability, or even death. Twelve years old is about the standard age for beginning your development. So, should Rita and I not train our magic during lunch? Dirk asked worriedly after hearing his mother. If training magic could hurt you, then was what they were doing bad for them? Dirk hadn't felt anything bad, but he didn't know anything about magic or the soul. Cecilia shook her head. If it's just playing around with mana, then no, that's fine. That might actually be good for you guys and can enhance your concentration. But you shouldn't push it too far. I'm not going to tell you what you shouldn't do, but just know, if you feel any sharp pains after doing things with mana, then you need to stop immediately. Never force anything with magic. Understood? Yes, mother. Dirk acknowledged strictly. He was glad to learn what to avoid. He was very capable of managing his pain and mitigating injury with his body, but beyond that, he knew nothing. He would just take his mother's advice. She had no reason to mislead him. Good. Now, go clean up and head to the dining room. Since you're training now, you should eat meals more. It'll help with recovery. You can have a meal before dinner, okay? Understood. Then go on. Cecilia waved Dirk off as he stood up. He went straight to his room to bathe before coming back out to an already cooked meal. He sat and scraped everything off his plate quickly. Now, eat and listen since I told your father I would teach you this. Cecilia appeared and sat down across from him as he ate, setting a book down on the table as she did so. He nodded with a mouthful of meat while some of the maids continued to prepare more food. Chore magic is something nearly everybody knows besides the absolutely ordinary. Like your father said, anyone with a modicum of mana can learn these four basic spells. Sweep, gust, waterball, and spark. Each is of the four elements, and if you don't have the affinity for a particular element, you'll need to know the spell. You have attributes for earth and fire, so you really only need to know the spells for water and air. For now though, I'll teach you all four. Now, let me explain what spells are. Cecilia opened the book she had put on the table. The page she opened to had two complicated diagrams and descriptions under them. Spells are magical constructions magicians use to direct and codify their magic. These constructions have been created and improved upon for millennia. They were initially discovered through analyzing the workings of the nature of mana and its interactions with our minds and souls. After countless trials and error, we have the spells we now use today. Each spell has two parts, the circuits that direct the mana, and the runes that give the mana directions. The circuits direct the mana along a pathway, the mana is given directions on what to do and how to do it by the runes, and then it is ejected with the intended effects. Naturally this is an extremely simple explanation, and not all spells work like this, but this is enough for chore magic. Now, watch me and see how I form this spell. Cecilia brought up her hand, and Dirk stopped eating for a moment. He watched as mana was controlled around her hand, forming a single circle in the air with a single line of runes around it. After that, a ball of fire was created above the circle. This is a spell. Maintain the circle, and you maintain the effect. Mana is consumed in the process of both forming the circle and fueling the flame. 
cut off your mana, and it all goes away. The fire went out as she spoke, and the circle faded into nothing. Dirk was frozen still, but he had seen and even recorded everything with his AI. He still couldn't get over how amazing that magic was. Mother, why don't I see that circle though when you or the maids usually use magic? Dirk asked as he remembered all the times he had seen that exact flame around the house. Everyone always used magic, but he never saw the circle that just appeared above her hand. Had they just hidden it? That's because we don't need to form the circle. For people who have either practiced enough or are powerful enough, they can simply perform the magic directly, skipping the process of making a circle. While this is more difficult, it's faster, less obvious, and can actually consume less mana. Understood. Now, this will take some time, but I want you to try and form a circle. We will teach you the runes after you know how to do at least that. To make things easy, I want you to direct the fire mana around you and create the circle using it. The fire mana should revolve through the circle. Try it. Dirk nodded as his mother brought up her hand again, forming only the circle as a demonstration. He could detect the fire mana traveling around and around the circle continuously. Seeing that, he attempted it. He brought up his own hand and pulled some fire mana out of the air. He then directed that mana with his mind, controlling it to form the circle. The fire mana listened to his instructions and fell into place, but as he tried to solidify the circle, it got harder and harder to control. Eventually, before he was able to form an actual solid circle, the whole thing dissipated. Good job. You've got the concept right. Don't worry about it falling apart. You'll need to work on your concentration over time so you can force everything together. This is your first time, and that's actually more than what I expected. Understood. Dirk nodded plainly. She was right in that he needed to work on his concentration. While trying to form the circle, he had a hard time drawing upon his mental energy. On Earth, there was no such thing as drawing upon mental energy and actually receiving tangible results like this. He still wasn't used to how his mind interacted with this new magical energy, so he would definitely need to work on it. Go ahead and try again. Just focus on drawing in the energy around you. Forming the circle can come later. Dirk was silent as he listened, bringing up his hand and trying again. This time, the mana flowed to his hand smoothly, but forcing it into the shape of a circle was difficult. He felt like his mind was shaky as he forced the energy into a particular shape. And just like last time, everything eventually dispersed. Cecilia was happy with that though. Good. The only thing that you can do is keep practicing, and it'll become easier. When you can comfortably create that circle, I'll then teach you the runes. Those are the hardest part. Understood. Hmm. Go ahead and finish eating. I'm gonna go check on your father. Cecilia stood as she said that, leaving Dirk to eat the serving of food that had been recently cooked. He didn't dig in right away though and continued to practice making the circle until he was drained. Only then did he eat. As it turns out, the food his parents have been feeding them was filled with manna as well. It had even more than the stuff at the cafeteria. And now that he thought about it, it tasted better too. Was it because of the manna? Who knew? From that day forward, Dirk's routine consisted of waking up, going to school, practicing magic at lunch, coming home, working out, and then practicing magic again. The workouts his mother gave him weren't too difficult. At most, they had him working out for around half an hour, maybe an hour if she wanted a difficult day. Because of this, Dirk went on and did his own additional workouts. His lasted two hours, and by the end of each one he was heaving for breath. Because of the training from his life on earth, he knew what a six-year-old could handle without getting injured. And that was without any cybernetic enhancements. In this new life, he had his enhancements right off the bat, so he could handle much more. It only took a week for his normal workouts to start becoming tolerable, and he had to start upping the intensity gradually. As time went on, he also got much better at wielding mana. The lack of familiarity with utilizing his mental energy went away, and he was able to succeed in replicating Rita's Dark Wisp trick. However, that in itself took nearly three weeks. 
In that time, Rita had moved on to harder things, leaving him behind once more. Fortunately, the wisp trick wasn't his only success. A week after he did that, he was able to successfully form a magic circle. This opened him up for learning the runes his mother told him about. Unfortunately, since she apparently didn't expect him to succeed so fast, she gave him another goal, which was to learn how to read and write fluently before moving. This goal didn't seem like it had anything to do with learning magic, but she assured him that it did. She had originally shown Dirk a book with magical writings, but he wasn't able to read it at all. This was a problem that needed to be solved so while it bummed Dirk out to wait more, he agreed that he needed to learn these language skills quickly. Luckily, after only a month more, he was became more fluent in the written language. Anything he learned, such as the alphabet or words and definitions, was logged into his AI, and a comprehensive language format was created. That was another thing Dirk greatly enjoyed. The school frequently had tests to make sure students were keeping up with their learning. For Dirk, there were tests on spelling and definitions, and Dirk would ace every one. This was natural as he had his AI. He couldn't possibly get things incorrect if he had already seen it before. The only thing he didn't enjoy was how slow class moved. Because of that, it took a whole three months from the start of school in order for him to become completely proficient. He now had several hundred words in his vocabulary, and his grammar was impeccable. While there was still slang, that would take time to pick up on through experience. There was also a lot of unique vocabulary that he was unfamiliar with, but all he had to do was ask what it meant from either his teacher or parents. Now, he could read and write. And when he was finally confident in his reading abilities, Dirk remembered one thing he had been waiting to do for a while now. He went to his sister and requested to read her books. Rita. Dirk. After knocking on a bedroom door, Dirk could hear Rita's voice. It was nighttime and a short time before they needed to go to sleep, but Dirk was outside Rita's bedroom. Rita jumped out of bed and opened the door. Dirk had never come to her bedroom of his own accord. It was very surprising, but she was more than happy to see him. Come in. Rita didn't even ask why he was there and pulled him in, shutting the door behind him. She then pranced back to her bed. I have something to ask you. What's up? I wanted to see your school books. My books? Hearing that, Rita turned to him with a questioning face. Kids like her hated studying and anything related to school. Why would Dirk actively go out and request to see her books? I wanted to see the stuff inside them. It seemed interesting. Ah, uh, I guess. It's nothing that interesting, just a bunch of boring history and stuff. Where's your bag? Over there. Rita pointed to a desk against one of the walls. Dirk also had a desk, and it's where they did schoolwork. Dirk walked over and saw her bag on top of the desk. He grabbed the book that was hanging out of it and looked at its cover. World Studies. Seeing the title, he smiled. It was exactly this kind of information that he wanted to see. He didn't open it quite yet though and looked at the others. After pulling two more books out, he saw one which was history and the other which was science. Very nice. Now, the grin was obvious. When Rita hopped off her bed and walked over though, he wiped the smile off his face and sat down in the chair next to the desk. He opened the World Studies book. That book talks about the world and stuff. Apparently there are other empires besides ours. One of the empires is full of hybrids like Tess and your friend Ava and there's another one with a bunch of dwarves. Rita spoke as Dirk opened the first pages of the book. He first looked at the table of contents. Basic geography, nations of the world, dungeons of the world. Dirk looked through, and all the while his AI was scanning the page, documenting it. He was immediately confused though. Dungeons? What were those? He looked at the page number and flipped to it, coming upon a section. Introduction to Dungeons Dungeons are systems of draconic layers that are present throughout the lands. There are six major dungeons of the world, each associated with each of the six elements. There are also their lesser dungeons, and they are home to myriads of hostile creatures. Dirk scanned through the introduction, 
and he became increasingly puzzled. Draconic layers? Associated with each of the six elements? He kept reading, and as he did, he became increasingly baffled. Apparently, throughout the world, there were thousands of dungeons. These dungeons were restricted areas that were filled to the brim with various hostile creatures called monsters. The monsters could vary wildly depending on the dungeon, but the most popular monster was a dragon. The dragons seemed to be the overlords of these dungeons, or at least, they were the symbol that represented the dungeons. Dirk could see pictures of the dragons on some of the other pages, along with pictures of other wild creatures. The dragons looked surprisingly varied. Of the four pictures he saw, one had red scales, another had feathers and wings almost like a bird, the third had skin that seemed to be made of rocks and stone, and the last had the scales of a fish, as well as fins and two long whiskers like a catfish. Dirk immediately understood that each of these dragons was associated with each of the four elements besides light and dark. He became even more intrigued, and all the pictures were documented by his AI. He went on to look at the other pictures too. There were deadly werewolves, giant troll-like creatures, menacing snakes, and savage rodents. None of these pictures seemed to be from the imagination of an artist. The pictures captured the monster's threatening image well, and the details about them were specific. Dirk didn't mind any of this. While he thought they did look a bit scary, he wasn't so easily shaken. However, he wondered why something like this would be put in a children's school book. Wasn't this a bit much? Were they trying to terrify these kids? Moreover, did they really need to know about these dungeons as children? Just how in depth did these books go? While Dirk was unfamiliar with a normal school's curriculum, he was pretty sure young kids didn't learn this kind of stuff. Then again, Earth also didn't have dungeons. Dirk shook his head. While he was pondering, Rita was also gazing at the pictures. She didn't seem to care about their threatening image. She seemed to enjoy the looks of the dragons more anyway. They were more majestic and eye-catching. Dragons are so cool. One of the kids in my class has a pet dragon. It's really small. A pet dragon? Yeah. Apparently you can find them in the wild. They're really expensive though to buy as pets. You need to use something called a contract to control them. What's a contract? Hmm, I don't know. Rita rubbed her chin in thought. Dirk also pondered. This contract probably wasn't what he knew it to be. It was likely magical. Otherwise, was someone supposed to get a wild animal to sign a paper and listen to them? This contract sounded something like a leash, though he had no idea how it would possibly work. Chapter 12 Casting Slash Trust Dirk continued to read the book, documenting every image. He learned more information as he did, and he didn't only read the section on dungeons. He spent over an hour flipping through every page from front to back. By the time he went through the last of the information, Rita was already fast asleep on her bed. Dirk learned that this world was known as Gaia. This name was given to the world by the elves, who were most attuned with nature. The world was actually only a single continent. Dirk likened it to the theoretical Pangaea continent from Earth. However, the continent wasn't totally solid. In the middle of the continent was a sea. This made the whole landmass look like a donut. On this continent, there were several different dominant empires. Each empire was controlled by a different main race. First, there were the humans who resided primarily in the Horizon Empire. Dirk and his noble household lived in this empire's capital. This empire was known as the most diverse empire since the humans didn't actively prevent other races from entering and settling here. However, humans still outnumbered every other race by far. The Horizon Empire was located on the northwest corner of the continent. Second, there was the Dwarven Haven. They were located east of the Horizon Empire, on the north section of the continent. Their empire was built into a mountain. From the textbook, the dwarves sounded like a very rugged but money-savvy group. Then, there was the Unity Empire, home to the beast kin, or hybrids. This empire was located to the right of the Dwarven Haven. The Dwarven Haven actually separated the Unity Empire and the Horizon Empire. 
Because of this, the Dwarven Haven was a trade hub, which made them very rich. As for the Unity Empire, they were located among dense rainforests, giving them vast supplies of natural resources. Fourth was the Dark Kingdom. They were located to the south of the Horizon Empire, on the western section of the continent. This kingdom was home to the vampire race. Upon seeing this, Dirk thought it was ironic. The human empire was neighbors with the vampire empire. Were the humans enemies with them? If these vampires sucked blood, then he would guess so. Lastly, there was the world tree, home to the elves. This world tree was literally a massive tree, and it could create other subtrees known as trees of life. These smaller trees of life were used to expand the elven territories, so they took up vast amounts of land. The world tree was located on the south section of the continent, rather distanced from all the other empires. As he read, Dirk referenced the map that took up a whole page. While it wasn't exact or incredibly accurate, it did enough to give him a general overview. He could see the vast donut continent, the ocean surrounding it, and the sea within its center. Then, there were the dungeons. The dungeons were separated into different types based on their size, or so it's said in the book. There were the six major dungeons, and one dungeon was controlled by each of the empires. Then there were the lesser dungeons that surrounded those major dungeons. There were hundreds of them throughout the continent. Dirk quickly found a problem though. There were six major dungeons, but only five empires. Where was the sixth? The book didn't give the exact locations of the dungeons, only telling him that they were controlled by the empires. He eventually just shook his head though. This was a book for a children's school. He couldn't expect the most accurate or in-depth intelligence. When Dirk was done scanning through the World Studies book, he went for the science book. He wanted to know what level of basic academic knowledge this world developed. And upon flipping through it, he was pleasantly surprised. The biology field seemed developed. The book talked about the various systems of the human body. While it didn't go into extensive detail so as to know about cells or even deeper concepts, the understanding of the body was more than enough to establish good medical practices. Then there was the engineering. Mathematics were almost identical to Earth's as Dirk had seen from his own books, and upon looking at the science book, he saw that there was some semblance of engineering expertise. It talked about geometry and carpenting, as well as how some machines worked, the most popular of which was the printing press. Because of this, books weren't so expensive. Even the paper-making industry was developed, so this world must have made advances in chemistry and such. It seemed to Dirk that this world was headed on a track similar to Earth, only less reliant on engineering to advance. From the science book, he saw that magic played a huge part in discovering the functions of the body and in engineering. There was this process called enchanting that could strengthen materials, so this made people less worried about architecture and such. Naturally, this would stunt the progress of the engineering and physics fields since they could compensate with magic, but there wasn't much of a way to avoid that. Also, it meant that only people without magical ability had the inclination to advance the sciences, making progress even slower. Unfortunately, Dirk wasn't a scientist or an engineer, so he wasn't able to contribute much in the way of science. The knowledge he knew was what he was taught so as to further his ability to kill and adapt. This encompassed a lot, but knowing the how of something didn't mean you knew the why. Dirk really only knew the how. He wasn't concerned with the why. With that, Dirk finished documenting the science book. Lastly, he moved on to the history book. There wasn't much to learn here though. There was definitely some interesting information, but he didn't think it would help him that much, especially since he was only six years old. He still documented every page though, just in case. Dirk looked at one of the clocks on Rita's nightstand. This was one technology that had been developed mechanically. It was already past midnight, and Rita was snoring away. Seeing that, he put the books back in her bag before rearranging things to the way they were before. He then left without making a sound, something he was very good at. Time passed, and it was now ten months past the start of school. Dirk was now seven years old. Concentrate. Dirk mumbled with his eyes focused on his palm. 
A red circle appeared above it as the fire mana solidified quickly. Dirk had worked extensively on his magic circle, and now it was fluid. He never failed anymore. Now though, he was practicing the next step. His mother had already taught him the runes for this chore magic spell, so he just needed to focus and apply them. As he focused on his palm, lines began to appear around the magic circle. One rune was formed, and then two. Dirk formed each rune line by line until there were six runes. Last one. When he got there, he focused harder. Gradually, the seventh rune took shape. As it did though, the whole circle threatened to disperse. No! With a surprisingly competitive spirit, Dirk moved all his mental energy and formed the last line. He couldn't even count how many times he had failed here. While he was mostly numb to failure, he still got annoyed after failing hundreds if not thousands of times. He was close now though. And with one last push, the final line was formed. Once it was, the instability instantly disappeared, and Dirk's mana cycled through the circle. Ha! Ha! ha. With a rare smile, Dirk chuckled. He looked at the finally completed spell above his hand and appreciated the fruits of his hard labor. He had drained his mental energy countless times for this single spell. It took nearly a year. But he had done it. Even without the results though, Dirk still appreciated being able to work towards something. Both his workouts and practicing magic were two productive things he could do for several hours each day. Not long after the spell formed though, something happened. Dirk saw a notification pop up in front of his eyes. It wasn't the magical system, but his AI. Alert! Completed magic formation detected. Would you like to save the formation? Seeing this, Dirk averted his attention. Meanwhile, the spell above his hand was activated and created a tongue of flame. He didn't notice even as it started burning his mana. I can save this. Wait, this AI can detect magic? But it's cybernetic. Wait. As Dirk thought, he suddenly realized. This AI had even detected when someone else's mana was invading his body. Now, it could detect the spell formation. He didn't realize until now that this wasn't the same AI he knew, one that was implanted into his brain. So it really can. But what would saving this formation do? I guess. Oh well, let's just say yes. Dirk stopped thinking about it and gave the okay. Confirmed. Saving magic formation. Formation saved. You can now cast, chore magic, spark, dot. Note, casting spells requires set amounts of mana. You cannot cast spells that you do not have sufficient mana for. Dirk read the notifications and was surprised. It said he could cast it. Did that mean instantly? Would the AI do it for him? Or did he just unlock the ability to do so? Dirk questioned, but suddenly, he felt incredibly weak. He looked at his hand and the tongue of flame that had been burning all this time. Damn it! Cursing, Dirk shook his hand and dispersed the spell. That didn't do much to help his now throbbing head though. He had burned too much mana. I forget. Once you form the spell, it sustains itself until mana is cut. He thought with a sigh and sat down. It was night time, and he had just been doing his last practice of the day. Unfortunately, he wouldn't be able to test what this new function of the AI was now. He would have to wait until morning. Oh well. Shrugging, Dirk crawled under his covers. In only a minute, he was out cold. The next morning, Dirk quickly woke up. He didn't even clean himself before sitting up and bringing up his palm. Interface. Awaiting commands. Dirk smirked when he heard that familiar robotic response. Cast the spark spell. Confirmed. As soon as the AI responded, Dirk could feel mana congeal around his palm. It moved very quickly, and in only one second, the mana had solidified into the circle and written the runes. Dirk was shocked as the completed spell appeared above his hand. He hadn't thought it would be so fast. Not only that, the spell was made perfectly. I worked so damn hard to even cast it once. But this thing can just instant cast it? 
Dirk didn't know if he should be happy or mad. Regardless, he could simply use the AI to cast the spell now. It would definitely be easier. Unlike when he did it, the cast was fast, precise, and it only used a set amount of mana. While he could also feel a mental energy draw, it wasn't nearly as bad as him doing it himself. He would need several tries to get it right once. This thing could do it on command. Well, this should be useful. Wait, but can it cast spells directly? The maids don't show the spell circle when they cast, going straight for the fire. Interface, can Spark be directly cast? Dirk asked his AI. Negative. Casting that bypasses the formation can only be done by the caster. This interface is not yet capable. Yet? What are the conditions to enable direct casting? To be capable of direct casting, the caster must supply a sufficiently capable platform. Current platform does not meet requisites. Hmm. Dirk went into thought. By platform, the AI meant his body. Dirk guessed that he wasn't powerful enough so as to enable his AI to do more. Though, he was confused as to how his AI knew that direct casting would be possible. Interface. What's the source of information for the direct casting requisites? Alert. Unable to answer. No relevant data. Huh. That concerns me. Dirk frowned, but he couldn't think of anything that could explain this AI's expanded abilities. Maybe just the fact that it was now a skill instead of a cybernetic component meant it would be different. In fact, as he used it, he found it speaking and responding more fluidly, and not as rigid like a robot. That wasn't to say that it was anywhere near being sentient and such, but he noticed the changes. Oh well. Dirk. Suddenly, a voice came from his bedroom door. Dirk dispersed the spell still hovering above his palm as he watched Rita fly through the doors. Hi Rita. Hey! You ready for your last day? Rita jumped excitedly onto his bed, and Dirk remembered what he was doing today. It was their last day of school, so they would be graduating today. There was going to be a ceremony and everything, though Dirk wasn't so thrilled. The whole school year had been very slow for him. He was just glad to be moving on. But when he remembered that he still had three more years, his head throbbed. Dirk didn't respond to Rita as he pulled himself out of the covers. She instead moved to where he just was, indulging in his lingering body heat and falling back asleep. After Dirk cleaned up a bit and made himself presentable, he grabbed Rita, who moved to piggyback on him. Him carrying her down to breakfast was practically a daily routine now. The only thing weird about it was how she was still bigger than he was. But with his strength that's been continuously improved for a year now, carrying her wasn't a problem. After the two went down and ate breakfast, they eventually made their way to school. This time, Dirk, Rita, and their mother went to the school together. They were dressed in nice clothes befitting the luxury afforded by a Marquis, though not so much that they stuck out like sore thumbs. Dirk. As they walked onto the grounds, Dirk heard his name. He turned and saw Ava approaching him with her parents in tow. Compared to the beginning of the year, Ava had changed greatly. At first, she was a constantly paranoid and shy girl who wouldn't so much as make a peep if nobody paid attention. Now though, she had become more confident, and she walked around with her head up. She also made a couple of friends in the class, though Dirk still remained her go-to for some reason unbeknownst to him. Both of them had grown. They were still growing children after all. For Ava though, her antlers had gone past being stubs and were now like little sticks coming out of her forehead. Dirk likened it to two horns. At first, he thought it was weird. But over time he stopped noticing and got used to it. Hi Ava. Hi. The two greeted each other, but that was about the extent of their usual communication. Normally they would just greet each other and then simply be in each other's presence, going about their days. But now, there was family here, and they expected more than just two simple highs. They stood there awkwardly as they thought of what to say, but with Dirk not being a social person and Ava being even more reclusive, no words came out. Truly a man of few words. Hey, why don't we attend the ceremony together? Cecilia spoke as she stood behind Dirk. 
Ava nodded, as did her parents. The two families went on to go about the last school day. The ceremony was simply going around the classrooms and presenting the big projects that all the students completed. Lots of the projects were art pieces that the students enjoyed showing their parents. Upon seeing Dirk's art though, Cecilia was surprised. His stood out from the others quite a bit. The art was of a portrait. For this particular assignment, every student had to copy a portrait as best they could onto their own canvas. Most of the students' pieces were messy, inaccurate, or just plain crazy. But Dirk's was strict, and it was almost a perfect replication. The only reason it didn't match exactly was because the coloring scheme given to Dirk was different than that of the portrait. This is impressive, Dirk. Cecilia praised as she picked up the picture. The portrait was actually of the emperor, though the kids didn't particularly care about that. Not even the adults were sure if that was the emperor's real appearance. This was just the widely accepted image. The man looked rough, but valiant. Strong and grounded. The portrait was truly the image of a king. Dirk had captured the image almost exactly on his canvas. Just by itself, the picture looked perfectly fine. One could use his image as the portrait as well. I simply tried to copy the picture, like the teacher told us. If I were given more colors, I could copy it better. Right? Cecilia wasn't sure how to respond. Did he not know how impressive his project was? He didn't seem happy at all, as if doing this was something expected of him. Sometimes, Cecilia wasn't sure how to handle this stoic child of hers. He was so strict, stricter than her husband or any other of her children. Both her and Riker were troublemakers as kids. That was normal for every child, especially those on the path to power. Arrogance and pride were common as children couldn't help but be boisterous over their achievements. But Dirk was quiet. Really quiet. He didn't ask questions often, and even the few times he did were the result of Cecilia's urging. Besides that, he only spoke when spoken to and observed from afar. He never sought comfort or attention, just going about his days with only productivity in mind. Workouts were the only times that Cecilia saw any form of emotion in the form of determination, and even then she couldn't understand how he could put himself through such discomfort so easily. He had never once complained about anything. It wasn't normal. But what could she do? She just continued loving that son of hers. She was able to learn some things though, at least. When he was younger, Dirk never quite enjoyed skinship or anything intimate. But over time, she noticed how he came to tolerate it, and then enjoy it a bit. Now whenever she wanted a hug from him, he would lean in and relax. It was small, but she came to know that that was his way of accepting her love. Thinking about that, she smiled lovingly and pulled Dirk into her embrace. He didn't resist as she kissed him on the forehead and held him tightly. Sure enough, she could feel his taut muscles relax, a sign of his trust. That made her even happier, and she held him for a little while longer. Chapter 13, Runes Slash Graduation The last day of school passed quickly, and everyone was soon enjoying their summer break. Not much changed for Dirk though. He still continued to work out and practice magic. Now, Cecilia didn't even have to plan his workouts. He simply rotated between workouts that target different muscle groups. At least, that's what he did in front of her. While on his own, he would train himself into the ground. However, there was one change that Cecilia decided to make. Dirk didn't only train his muscles but also did cardio. He would run several miles a day, and his running path was a trail around the Marquis neighborhood. While the word neighborhood implied that they were close together, the case was actually the opposite. Each estate was large, larger than mansions on earth. They were also spaced nicely, so just running around his own house would be a good enough trail that he would simply run a few times. That's actually what he did for the past year. Lapping his house would keep things simple and keep him safe. But now, Cecilia decided to bring him to a different area to run. The two left the house and jogged to a plot of land outside of the Marquis neighborhood. This land was covered in trees and rough terrain. I want you to run here from now on. 
running in this area requires you to watch your footwork and move around trees. It'll be more taxing, and you won't always be running on flat ground, so it's good to start getting used to rough terrain now. I'll run with you for the next week or so until you remember the route, and then you can come here by yourself. Okay, follow me. Saying that, Cecilia started running straight into the forest. Dirk quickly followed while memorizing the path they took. He took in all the details around him. The trees, the bushes, the dirt, the grass, any branches on the floor, piles of leaves, and even the nests of birds. He was very observant as they ran for several minutes, and it was only when his mother stopped that he realized that they exited the forest. This is the end of this forest patch. Over there is another portion of the city. You see that clock tower right there? If you see that, then just go the opposite way to return home. Dirk nodded as they looked at the city. There were buildings around 200 meters away, and the tallest one was a clock tower. It was indeed a good landmark to remember. As for the rest of the buildings, they seemed to look like shops or hotels or even apartment complexes. This wasn't a high-class area of the city, but it wasn't poor either. It was almost like a suburb. All right, let's go back. How about you lead? Understood. Dirk nodded before turning around. He definitely remembered the way back, and even if he didn't, his AI had charted a map. Everywhere he went was logged, so he would never get lost unless he was transported while unconscious. Sure enough, Dirk ran on exactly the same path they came on. Cecilia was yet again surprised by his memory. I'm not sure if you should be a ranger or a scholar. Anyway, good job. I'll still come with you for a couple of days, but after that you can come run on your own. Understood. Hmm. Oh. I almost forgot. How is your progress with the spark spell? Cecilia asked as they walked back into the house. Dirk put up his hand in response. Cecilia watched as a circle slowly took shape. Each of the runes were then written around it, and once the seventh rune was completed, a small ball of fire was created. Dirk had decided to cast the spell personally instead of shocking his mother with an instant cast. Fantastic! Such a talented boy! I didn't think you would learn the spell in a year. Ethan was taught the spell at eight years old, and he was only able to cast it himself at ten. You've done a very good job. Now, would you like to learn the other spells too? Yes. Dirk nodded eagerly. He was close to asking his mother himself so he could learn the runes. The more spells he knew, the better. Plus, he was interested in how he would go about casting the gust and water ball spells, two elements he didn't have the attributes for. All right then. Come here. I will teach you the runes for the earth element sweep spell. After that you can move on to the water ball spell. Saying that, the two went back to the house where Cecilia brought out a book and taught Dirk the runes. Being able to cast the spark spell, he was naturally able to easily form an earth element magic circle. Only the runes needed to be memorized and then worked on. He thought, if all went well, then he would be able to cast the sweep spell in a month. Come on! Last rune. Alert. Completed magic formation detected. Yes. Dirk smiled excitedly as he saw a green magic circle take form above his palm. The earth and mana revolved around the circle continuously, forming a closed loop. Upon his command, the circle would activate and control any light objects within a range of 10 meters, pushing them away. This was the sweep spell, and simple spell usually used to brush away dirt on floors. Dirk has just completed it, and just like with the spark spell, the AI detected the magic formation. Dirk gave an affirmative, and it was saved to cast later. The next moment though, his mood worsened. It was almost two months since the end of his first year in school, meaning it had taken two months to complete this spell. He was disappointed that it took double the time he initially thought. The reason it took a lot longer was because the function of the runes were very different than the fire spell. The runes meant totally different things, and Dirk had a hard time indicating its parameters. He had to slowly understand the runes and then create them. Runes, as Dirk had come to know, weren't so simple. 
they weren't just lines and symbols. Each rune held data, and each rune needed to be imbued with that data by Dirk personally. The runes indicated how the mana would interact with the surrounding matter, as well as all the other indicators such as area of effect, objects that he desired to control, the speed of mana consumption, and more. Dirk had a hard time getting used to the system of runes. The way that runes were formed was foreign to him. It was like speaking some kind of language. In fact, that was actually how Cecilia explained it to him. She said that runes were a magical language discovered by interacting with mana and nature, breaking down their inner workings. It could be said that runes were a truly magical language, but that would be understating how profound they were. Runes were the medium by which the people of the world systematically controlled mana and manipulated nature. Normally, people could only play around with mana by pulling at places, like Dirk and Rita would do during their lunches at school. But with runes, they were able to form spells with specific effects. Runes were what created magicians. And after one learned runes and were able to fluently cast spells, they could go from writing this language in the form of spells to speaking this language in the form of direct casting. Direct casting was achieved through, for lack of a better description, casting the spell internally with your mind. Your mind became the circle, and the runes were written by the soul, forming a spell and using your body as the medium to cast. This eliminated the magic circle, consumed less mana, was silent, and could be faster than normal. However, it took more skill and concentration. Visualization was a significant part of human cognition. Direct casting was like writing a poem blind. Dirk still hadn't figured out direct casting but his mother told him not to worry about this. She said that he first needed to establish a magic technique, and then he would need to learn more runes. Through this, his mind would become more powerful, and he would understand the nature of runes more. Even then, she said that direct casting required lots of talent and a high affinity for the element of the spell. It wasn't something so easily done. Hearing this, Dirk decided not to set the bar too high. Forming these small chore spells that anyone with a modicum of mana could do was already hard enough. He knew there was a lot out there that he had yet to learn about, so he took it one step at a time. These past seven years of being a child were really good at developing his patience. And so, Dirk moved on to attempting the water ball spell. This was probably the most useful chore spell in the world as it could create water out of thin air in exchange for the consumption of mana. It couldn't be understated that water was the most essential resource for all life, so naturally it would be the most widely used spell. Dirk couldn't imagine how many lives had relied upon this very spell throughout this magical world. However, Dirk immediately realized how difficult it would be to perform the spell. Unlike for earth and fire, he didn't have the water attribute. When looking at mana, he could barely sense moisture from the gray fog around him, an indicator of the water mana. Runes required his manipulation of the element, something that was easy for earth and fire. But he could barely see the water mana, let alone control it. It was because of this that Dirk's first day of attempts was for naught. He literally got nowhere. He couldn't even form a circle, let alone try to write the runes. Ultimately, he had to settle for first trying to even interact with water mana. He couldn't predict how many times he would need to drain his concentration to pass this step but he knew it would be a lot, and it would take a much longer time to get anywhere. Dirk wasn't sure if he could do it within a year. That didn't get him down though. If he could get through school, then he could get through this. Nothing was as mind-numbing as listening to a teacher drone on for hours about the letters of the alphabet. Time continued to pass quickly. Dirk eventually went back to school, and with his keen memory and trusty AI, he blazed through classes with top marks. He was always at the top of his class and had become a bar that the rest of the competitive children sought to match. Surprisingly, Ava was always right behind him. Dirk guessed it had something to do with her mental powers, whatever they were. School was the least of his concerns though. His top priority was practicing magic, and working out was a close second. He did these two things every day without fail. Cecilia became more and more proud of her son's determination, and whenever Riker visited home, he would always congratulate Dirk on surviving his wife's brutal workout regime. This always confused Dirk though. 
Cecilia always seemed to take it easy on him. His own workouts were the brutal ones. Besides working out though, Riker was extremely pleased to see Dirk's ability with magic. While Dirk had countless troubles with casting the water ball spell, that was beyond his attributes and Riker didn't even consider it. He always enjoyed seeing his son's spark spell, and Dirk had been getting more proficient with the spell so he could cast it plenty fast. Though, there was one thing that stumped Dirk. After praising Dirk a bit, Riker had gone and cast a spark spell on each of his ten fingers, creating ten small fireballs. Dirk was baffled as he watched all ten spells form at the same time, and he suddenly realized that being able to perform the spark spell was absolutely nothing special. In his father's hands, it looked like nothing more than a parlor trick. Not long after his father cast the spells though, he earned a smack from his wife. She scolded him saying how he shouldn't kill Dirk's motivation like that. The two then got in a bit of an argument, and seeing that, Dirk's thoughts drifted elsewhere. Mom smacked Dad? While it was only across the head, he was intrigued. In his life on Earth, he only knew the rough and tough gray. That man never yielded to anyone, and if someone tried that, he would pummel them. Gray would be just as harsh on females as he would males, and nobody was spared the rod. Dirk remembered a time when a superior female officer had tried to verbally fight Gray. It didn't end well for her, even though she was his superior. He didn't even get punished. The title of Super Soldier Drill Instructor earned him a unique position, one that could disobey superiors and talk directly to the president. So seeing this kind of submission from a man was interesting to Dirk. Weakness was a crime where he came from. He didn't know why his father would allow himself to be hit, regardless of who it was from and no matter how hard it was. And while it seemed as though Dirk was looking too deep into such a mundane occurrence, it struck a certain chord in him and made his thoughts run. He wondered what he would do. If Rita were to try and hit him, would he let it land? What about Ava? He thought it was an interesting dilemma. Regardless, life continued to move forward. Since Rita was now eleven, she was done with school, so she either stayed home or went out to see friends. Dirk continued his life, and before he knew it, a year passed. In this year, he completed his second year of school and turned eight. Then, another year passed with him turning nine. By that time, Rita had gone off to the academy and he was now the last of the children yet to leave the house. Dirk continued growing all the same, becoming stronger and faster. Surprisingly, he was capable of amazing feats of strength despite only being nine. His workouts were now lasting three hours with the difficulty of each session growing. And despite not using any weight, he knew that he had the strength of an adult at minimum. This was not only because of his enhanced body, but also because of that strange energy called anima. According to Cecilia, anima was naturally brought in by the body after working out, using it to recover. So when someone continuously worked out for long periods of time, they would naturally absorb some anima. However, they had to at least have the attribute, and luckily Dirk did. He would only continue to get stronger as he grew and worked out. This strength was even reflected by his profile. Profile Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, I. Rank, I. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7. Both his tier and his rank went up by a level. With Dirk being capable of casting two chore spells, he advanced. And the result of a few years of hard workouts was the rank going up from zero to I dash. Honestly, he was a bit disappointed seeing that though. That was three years of hard ass work. While he had no issue doing it, he would have enjoyed seeing a bit more progress. Nevertheless, he was moving forward. Every day he would go and run in the woods his mother showed him and then do his own workouts. Cecilia had eventually stopped monitoring his workouts since he never once slacked, so he was basically free to do as he wished. His training was now following a strict schedule where he would wear down certain muscle groups day by day. 
he did all kinds of unique workouts that never allowed his body to get used to a certain set of movements. Changing things up would prevent stagnation. Ha! Ah. Thud! Hiya! Snap! With a loud crack, a branch was blown in half. Dirk brought his leg down with a controlled motion, returning to a grounded state. Looking at his shin, one could see purple bruises and scabs along the bone. Both shins were like this. But Dirk's face didn't express anything as he simply shook his leg out. Currently, he was going through the last of his martial arts drills. Today he was focusing on kickboxing. Other days, he would focus on things like boxing. He mainly stuck to anything that revolved around striking. He couldn't exactly practice grappling with no partner. Initially, Dirk didn't plan to wait so long to practice martial arts. It was one of the things he wanted to do when he turned six. But he only started when he was nine, and that was because he didn't have a suitable place and wasn't in a suitable situation. In his home, there wasn't anywhere out of sight that he could practice, and his mother was always hovering around. But now that he was in the forest and his mother didn't watch him anymore, he could do what he wanted how he wanted. Plus, there were plenty of trees to practice with. This led to now. Currently, Dirk was ten years old, and on his last year of school. In fact, as he finished up his kickboxing practice, he could see the sunrise ending. It was just about time to go to school. This was how Dirk usually did his workouts. He would do martial arts in the morning, using the pain to wake himself up, and then after school he would do his usual workouts. Seeing how it was almost time, he jogged back to the house, disregarding his aching legs. As he entered, he slipped past everyone and headed to his room, putting on pants and heading back down for breakfast. After eating, he dressed himself proper and cleaned up. He then boarded the carriage he always took, bidding the driver good morning as he always did. His mother never took him to school or picked him up anymore. Normally, she was either out doing something somewhere or in the garden. Dirk had become responsible for himself from morning to evening. Though, the maid still prepared his food. The carriage quickly arrived at the school, and Dirk said goodbye to the driver as he disembarked. While walking to class, he met up with Ava. The two seemed to be on the same clock as they would always meet each other five minutes before class. If one didn't show on the minute that they usually did, the other would wait as walking in alone had become weird. The two took their seats in the back. Ava conversed with the girl next to her as Dirk sat in silence. While they had retained the same seats they chose at the beginning of the year, other seats moved around, and Ava was lucky enough to have one of her friends sat next to her. Ding! Dirk heard the bell ring, and the class automatically quieted down. Their teacher was already at her desk, but instead of the usual beginning of a lecture, she stood up and looked at everyone for a bit. We won't be doing much today, just some fun activities. You all have four days before graduation, so instead of filling your minds with more information, I want to talk about what you can expect going into the academy. Chapter 14, Reality Slash Request all the kids perked up hearing the teacher. Dirk also listened closer instead of zoning out. The academy is much different from this school. The work is harder, but more importantly, you all will finally be trained in either magic or body refining. While training yourself and gaining power sounds amazing, it's filled with trials, hardships, and danger. After stepping on that path, all of you will need to steal your hearts. The outside world is filled with death and destruction. It isn't the happy bubble that you all live in right now. The children quieted as the teacher enunciated her words with emotion. She wasn't joking, and everyone could tell. It seemed like she was speaking from experience. Body refining is full of pain, and learning magic is full of trials and errors that will make you want to give up. On top of that, all of you will likely experience some form of combat. This will take place in the dungeons or on a battlefield. Such a thing can't be avoided if you wish to advance in power. All people who reign over others have led lives filled with blood. If you wish to follow in the footsteps of those great men and women, you will also draw rivers of blood. The only other option is to die miserably, regretting the things you never accomplished. It is a life of bitter struggle and hopeless suffering. 
you all must know this, and think very carefully about the life you wish to live. The teacher eyed every student with a low voice. The room had become so silent that one could hear students talking in the classroom next door. The students were fearful. They had seen the monsters in the books, but they didn't truly know what it meant to be face to face with one. They were all playing out horrifying scenarios in their heads. Dead bodies, blood-curdling screams, their friends dying in front of them. Their imagination was sending chills down their own spines, making them want to cower behind a wall. Unfortunately, even then they couldn't know what it would really feel like. Their imaginations were watered-down versions of the truth. It lacked reality. Every student felt their hearts shake their bodies with forceful pounds. All except Dirk. He continued to simply gaze forward. Ava looked at him as she also felt herself tremble a bit. But when she looked at Dirk, she was stumped. How could he feel nothing? Ava had the peculiar power to lightly read psychological states. Upon looking at someone, she could sense the person's mind and feel their mental activity. For children, the minds she sensed were usually chaotic. For adults, they were deep and scary. For Dirk though, it was quiet. His mind was calm, though not in a serene way. It was simply still, not easily shaken and not boisterous. His thoughts were ordered, like a machine. Almost everything he did was like that. Strict and rigid. This was why Ava calmed when she looked at him. She sensed his calm and quiet and found herself mimicking it. It was a sense of stability, something she couldn't find in the children around her. And while she had gotten used to her power and the people around her, she was still drawn to Dirk. He was someone to simply follow. After all, he never wandered aimlessly. He always had some kind of direction to what he did. Meanwhile, Dirk was unaware of Ava's thoughts about him. He had never even asked about her power or why she was paranoid when she first came to the school. The only thing he noticed was her antlers which continued to grow month by month. Though, just because he didn't actively bond with her didn't mean he didn't value her. In fact, Ava would be shocked if she knew what Dirk would do for his first friend. For him, he had unconsciously assigned her his protection. He wasn't keen on seeing anything happen to someone he became friends with. He didn't want to experience any sort of loss. And there wasn't much he wouldn't do to ensure that. The teacher overlooked her fearful class and nodded inwardly. She had this talk with every class that came through, and she was serious about every one. It was good that they were scared. It would make them think harder when making decisions about their future. She wasn't worried about scaring them too much either though. As these kids went into the academy, they would forget their fears and valiantly push forward, stopping at nothing to become powerful. Their parents would encourage them, other students would encourage them, and the legends about godlike mages of power would encourage them. There was enough encouragement out there. What they needed was someone to ground them and pull their heads out of the clouds, if only a little bit. The rest of the class went on with the teacher talking to them about different aspects of the academy. It was all superficial knowledge though since the kids would learn all this stuff eventually. And those that didn't wouldn't be talented enough to enter the academy anyway. With that, the day passed mostly uneventfully. When the bell rang to signify the end of school, Dirk and Ava headed out for their carriages. As they waited in silence though, Ava suddenly spoke up. Are you going to the academy? She asked as she glanced at him. Dirk was simply waiting while watching all the carriages pass by, but hearing the question he looked at her for a second. Yeah, I am. My other siblings have already entered, so I will be too. Hmm. So will I. Really? Dirk turned to her with a surprised face. While she had gotten over her paranoia, she still didn't seem fit for the academy. A place with danger and struggle didn't seem like a place she would want to or should go to. Would she really be able to handle herself there? Ava saw his genuinely surprised face and pouted a bit. What? My affinity qualifies. No, I just... I didn't think you would want to go there. You're always timid. You can't be timid in a competitive place. Dirk spoke simply, and Ava went quiet. She turned her head down and hugged her book bag a bit. 
I'll get stronger. You'll need to. It's hard, but it's possible. Dirk spoke from experience. He remembered when he was a kid with no confidence. A scared, weak, and helpless child. He remembered all the times he wanted to give up under the grueling torture that was training. It was several years of being broken and breaking yourself, all in the hopes that someday you would be able to handle the suffering. And in the end, he was forged through blood and fire to become the weapon that he was. Though, at least with the help of Grey who acted as the father he never had, he was able to retain his humanity. In this way, he was never completely broken. Hearing his reassurance, Ava looked at him with a bit of naivety and hope. She suddenly thought of something and asked. How, did you become strong? We're still young. Her thoughts drifted off, but her question was clear to Dirk. How did he get his strength, his strict attitude? He pondered for a second before answering. Training. Training? I train my body every day. That's how you become strong. If you want to become less timid and become stronger, then you should train. I, don't know how. I guess I could show you. Dirk spoke as he looked at her. Ava was a small girl, not the kind that you would think to train. She was simply frail, and Dirk wondered if she was at all capable of running any noticeable distance. He wasn't too worried about that though. Anybody could train, that much was certain. The only variable was how hard they could train. Dirk knew the answer to Ava's problems. He knew what training could do to people. It could harden their mind and make them mentally strong. Training increased one's capacity for suffering, and when one was aware of their ability to suffer, they became more confident in their ability to handle problems. This was further amplified when one trained a martial art. The capability for violence was a great confidence booster when dealing with people. This was what Ava needed. She needed to suffer, and through that she would be hardened, bit by bit. Knowing this, Dirk came to a conclusion. His friend needed assistance. He was capable of providing that help. So he offered. Ava thought about Dirk's offer to train her. After a bit of silence, she nodded. Okay. I'll ask my parents. Your parents can't make the decision for you. Make sure they say yes. Oh, do you have the anima attribute? Machem. Ava nodded and Dirk suddenly became more confident in training her. While he had never been a teacher to anyone, training was as simple as doing a workout right? He would simply let her reach her limits and watch out for injury. It couldn't be that difficult. And with Anima, she could train beyond just bodily strength. Cecilia said Anima let people train to extreme strengths, no matter who they were. This would be good for Ava since she was just a girl. That's good. H.M., school is ending, so we can't train here. One of us will have to go to the other's house. Maybe you should talk to them about coming to my house. I train in the mornings and afternoons and have open spaces for running, so we can plan for those times. Okay. Just talk to your parents tonight. I'll talk to my mother as well. Tomorrow we can discuss the details. Okay. Good. Dirk nodded and turned his gaze back toward the line of carriages. Ava also went quiet, though her mind was stressing over how she would talk to her parents about this. Eventually, their carriages came, and they both went home. Mom. Oh, hi Dirk. When Dirk came back home, he approached his mother who was in the garden. She was tending to some strange plants that he had never seen before. He had gotten used to the alien sights though since this wasn't his first time here. Ava wishes to get stronger, so I have offered to assist in training her. I told her that since school is ending, one of us will have to go to the other's house. I've told her to try and arrange to come a dash. W8. Slow down. Cecilia stopped her gardening and put a hand up, prompting Dirk to go silent. She took a second to process his words. You want to train Ava? The deer hybrid? She wishes to gain strength, so I have offered her a way to do so through training with me. Okay. And you want her to come here? That would be easiest since we have the forest for running and open spaces for the exercises. I see. 
Cecilia gazed at her son who spoke simply. He didn't think anything of his proposition, and she knew that. She had come to learn her son's mannerisms throughout the years. However, this was the first time he had ever come to her with something like this. I guess allowing her over here wouldn't be a bad thing. Her parents need to agree first though. Also, are you planning on training her yourself? Yes. I know all the exercises and how to cycle them day by day, so I can form workouts. Yes, I'm sure you can, but her parents won't agree to you training her yourself. I let you work out by yourself since I trust that you know how to handle your body and know your limits. But she doesn't, and she needs a person who knows how to properly train someone. She needs to be trained by someone who can see her limits and guide her training systematically. That way she'll gradually make progress. Dirk went quiet. Going by those words, he wasn't qualified to be that person. But if he couldn't do it himself, then what was he supposed to do? Was this plan going to be abandoned just like that? Cecilia seemed to read her son's troubled mind though. She inwardly pondered for a bit before coming to a decision. If you really want to help her, then she can come over and I can train her. I'll need to talk to her parents though. None of this can happen unless they agree. I understand. Mim talk to Ava tomorrow and tell her that his parents can talk during graduation at the end of the week. I will. Good. Now go ahead and take care of your own training. Understood. Dirk turned and walked off with that. Cecilia watched him exit the garden before sighing. I guess I can't really turn him down. That's the first time he's ever asked anything of us. And it's his friend. Oh well. He's the last one yet to leave the house anyway. Shouldn't matter that we get connected to a couple of earls. Thankfully he doesn't have many friends. Er, I guess I shouldn't say that. Cecilia smiled and shook her head, going back to gardening. A few days later, Dirk and his mother arrived at school. The rest of the week had already gone, and today Dirk would be graduating. The graduation ceremony was something like a ball. All the kids would be called up and given some awards for their achievements in school, and then they would all be given certificates that signified the fact that they passed the school. This was all meaningless when taken beyond the school, but all the kids enjoyed getting awards and receiving attention, so the adults simply indulged them. After all, they wouldn't get something like this again for a while. The outside world wasn't so nice. Dirk and his mother either sat around a table or mingled among the parents during the ceremony. Cecilia had instructed Dirk how to carry himself in such a setting. This was another reason for the way the school put on this ceremony. Most of the parents that sent their children to the school were nobles of some kind. It apparently cost quite a bit to send a child, so only those with decent wealth could hope to enroll their kid. This meant that nobody there was poor. However, Dirk's mother and father were still the utmost echelons as Mericuses even considering all that. The reason the school hosted a ball was to familiarize all these noble children with the event and how it proceeded. These kinds of events were hosted fairly often and for all kinds of different reasons, so nobles needed to be capable of maneuvering it smoothly. It was a good learning experience, and the parents had their kids play along because of this. Dirk and his mother mingled for a bit before the graduation ceremony started. There, all the students went up and received their awards and certificates. Dirk, especially, was decorated. Because he had aced every assignment, project, and test since his first year, he received the highest academic award. Though, if it were up to him, he would rather give the award to Ava, who came in at a close second. He had his AI. Ava didn't. She was very likely much smarter than him. Dirk received his award plainly and gave no speech. He had been notified of his winning this award before, and it was then that he told the staff that he wouldn't give a speech, no matter what. They could only accept it and he got to walk off the stage without so much as opening his mouth. Thus concluded the graduation ceremony. The ceremony then moved on to the food phase where all the parents and kids were catered to. It was here that Dirk and his mother ate with Ava and her parents. So I hear that Ava wishes to train with Dirk, Miss Strider. I'm impressed that Dirk is able to maintain a schedule of exercise. Ava's father spoke respectfully. 
Cecilia was a Marquis, and he was an Earl. Despite being only one level below, their statuses were worlds apart. After all, in the Horizon Empire, status was determined by power and skill. Not only that, while Cecilia was only the wife of a Marquis, he had a feeling that she would have no problem earning the title herself. He could sense a faint but insurmountable power behind that humble appearance of hers. Cecilia nodded while taking a sip of wine. Indeed. Dirk trains for a few hours each day, morning and afternoon. He hasn't once skipped a day of training for four years. I see. That's even more impressive. Not even soldiers maintain such a schedule. The man spoke with slight disbelief, though Cecilia didn't fault him. Even she could barely believe it. Her son was unnaturally driven to pull off something like that at only ten years old. Even with her status, it would be hard to convince someone that it was the truth. Dirk has the anima attribute, and he came to me for guidance. I simply sent him on the right path, and he's been walking it ever since. He actually came to me saying that he wished to help Ava. What are your thoughts on Ava training her body? If that's what she wishes to do, then we won't stop her. Training one's body is good no matter what. She also has the anima attribute, so it surely wouldn't be for nothing. That's good. Since that's the case, Ava, do you wish to train? It's not easy, but if strength of body and mind is what you wish for, then training will give it to you. Ava was silent for a bit as she looked at Cecilia, and then Dirk. Dirk looked as if he didn't care for her decision. He would accept it either way. Cecilia also looked at her with a neutral stare. As for Ava's parents, they said nothing. Cecilia asked Ava, not them. Yes. I wish to train. All right then. In two days you can come to our residence. That will be your first day. I'll teach you all the different exercises that Dirk does, but you won't be working with him right away. He's far ahead of you, and it will take time for you to be capable of what he does. I understand. Ava nodded meekly. Cecilia then discussed the details with her parents. When they realized that Cecilia herself would train Ava, they wanted to pay, but she refused. If they were to pay for anything, they could chip in for meals which would let her eat with Dirk at the house. Otherwise, she would simply take on a bit more work. It wasn't like she was doing much after all. Once she set Ava down the right path, she would let Dirk take over. The ceremony eventually ended after the sun had set, and everyone took their leave. Dirk and his mother were quiet on the way back home, at least until Dirk broke the silence. Mom. Yes? Why are we starting the day after tomorrow? Dirk asked. He figured they would just start the next day. But his mother apparently didn't wish to. Tomorrow we have something to do. We're going to the Dukes to get you a mana development technique. You're ten now, so you should familiarize yourself with it for the next year or so before you enter the academy. We leave at noon, so be done with your workout before then. Understood. Dirk nodded with a bit of excitement. He remembered when Rita got her technique. She had been excited for a whole month and did nothing but read through it and practice the beginner parts. Now he was going to pick one. This technique was the one that he would use for potentially the rest of his life. It was the key to power and signified the beginning of his path. Even he looked forward to what was to come. Chapter 15 Requisite Slash Manual 44, 45, 46, 47 a boy who was doing sit-ups while hanging from the branch of a tree was calling out his reps, sweat dripped off his body and down to the grass and floor of beneath him. 56, 57, 58, 59. Alert! Self-replicating nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems have reached the requisite energy levels. Beginning construction. Ha! Huh. Surprised, Dirk stopped and looked at the notification. So I've finally developed enough, ha. Huh? Took long enough. Well, I guess I wasn't given that enhancement until I was twelve on Earth either. Hop. Flipping himself, Dirk agilely fell from the branch and landed on his feet. Despite only being a ten-year-old, Dirk's body was already starting to take form. When he was a super-soldier, 
he had to get modified and undergo many surgical procedures to enhance him with a superior body, genetics, and cybernetics. However, he now had all that from birth, and his body was able to develop into everything naturally. Now, he didn't have to adapt to everything and just built himself from the ground up. So while he wasn't a big kid, and his muscles were only just beginning to show, he knew that he definitely had a lot of strength. Several years of his grueling training was able to get his body into tip-top shape, and finally, one of his cybernetic abilities was unlocked. Because he was young, his body wasn't outputting a lot of energy. This meant his cybernetics couldn't draw on the necessary energy to power a system like the nano-repair bots. Now though, they were activated and he could already feel their construction inside his abdomen. The food and energy stockpiled in his body was quickly processed and drawn on, and he immediately felt hungry. I should ask for some more food. The more fuel I have, the more those bots can continue their construction. I don't want it to stop and then have to wait a long time for it to stockpile more energy again. Saying that, Dirk finished up his workout and headed back to the manor. When he arrived, a maid was waiting by the door. Have a good workout, Dirk? Yes, Miss Sanawa. Good. So how much are we eating today? Hmm, it's a lot, but triple the amount I usually eat. My my. Having a growth spurt again? Something like that. Dirk nodded as he and the maid walked into the manor. Sanala was the head maid, and with Dirk being the only child around the house now, she really only focused on catering to him. Much of what she did involved preparing him lots of food. The amount he ate grew by the month, but since he was the only one frequently there beside his mother, they had more than enough for his growing body. After cleaning himself up in his bathroom and dressing, Dirk arrived at the kitchen where all the food he asked for was sitting, freshly cooked. Nearly two pounds of meat were sitting on a large plate, sliced into thin strips. There was also a plate filled with thick slices of bread that were covered in melted cheese. Sitting and grabbing a piece of bread, he gobbled it up in one go. As soon as the bread entered his stomach, he could feel the accelerated digestion and the draw on the chemical energy given by the bread. Despite not being active, his body heat up a bit as his cells produced energy for the cybernetic construction. Feeling all that, Dirk went on to grab more slices of bread and strips of meat, stuffing his face with nutrient-rich food. His body was warm the entire time as everything was quickly digested. Two hours later, Dirk ate the last strip of meat. Despite eating so much, his body actually seemed leaner than before, a consequence of so much energy being burned. Much of the fat he had on him and nutrients within were taken away. Show me the nanite construction process. Dirk gave a command in his head to the AI interface as he gulped the last of the meat down. Nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems at 31% capacity. Unable to continue construction. Insufficient mineral reserves. Mm, makes sense. Dirk nodded seeing the insufficiency. To construct the nanites required minerals like iron and proteins, and he didn't have an infinite supply. But that was fine. As he ate more every day, more nanites would be constructed and gradually fill up his body alongside his blood. And since some had already been built, they would be able to store energy themselves and he wouldn't have to stockpile so much. They were a very versatile machine. Give it another week and I'll be set. Dirk? Are you home? Suddenly, a voice came from the entrance of the manor. Dirk recognized the voice and shouted back. I'm here, mother. Oh, good. I'm going to go freshen up, and your father is on his way. Once he gets here, we're leaving for the dukes. Understood. Nodding, Dirk quickly got up from the table and headed to his room to change into more formal clothes. You ready? Dirk's father spoke as he walked down to the hall. It was just Dirk and his parents going today. Yes, sir. All right, then let's head out. The three walked out of the manor and boarded the flying carriage, quickly taking off into the sky. Dirk watched as they rose from the ground and got a large view of the daytime city. Soon though, they were descending toward another residence. After landing on the runway street, they got off and walked over to the Duke's manor. Mark was Strider. Butler Gordon. 
After landing, Riker greeted the butler just like the last time they were here. That was six years ago though, and Dirk had grown a lot since then. The butler smiled seeing Dirk and motioned toward the house. The Duke awaits you. Please follow me. The butler led the family into the Duke's manor and off toward a certain room. After traveling down the hallway, they came up to a pair of fancy doors that slightly radiated mana. Knock knock. Come in. After tapping the doors, a voice was heard from within. The butler pushed open the doors and let the family in before closing it behind them. After walking inside, Dirk was immediately hit with a wave of dense mana. The place seemed almost stuffy with how dense it was. He didn't let it bother him though as he looked around. This room was a library. The first thing they saw through the doors was an open area with a table and chairs. Around that though were rows of tall bookshelves. The whole place felt old, like it was some kind of ancient repository. Even the stone below their feet seemed aged, as well as the roof of marble above them. You're here. Come. Let me see how much you've changed in six years. A loud voice came from the table in the center of the library. It was the Duke, and he was looking at Dirk with unbridled interest. The last time Dirk had seen the Duke was six years ago, but even today he looked no different. He was a man who radiated strength, and Dirk could feel that more than ever. His clothes looked incredibly expensive but also modest. All that combined with his combed back hair and scraggly beard made him seem like a rough but valiant man. The family walked forward, and Dirk approached the Duke while his parents took a seat at the table. Scanning him, the Duke nodded. I see you've been conditioning yourself. You have very good drive for a kid. It's not often you see someone so young who can force themselves to work out. Thank you, do Kilshire. Heh, <sighs> still as formal as always. Anyway, today you're here to pick out a technique. Take a seat and I'll explain things. Understood. Nodding, Dirk took a seat across from the Duke. He then went on to speak. When it comes to both mana and anima, there are different ways to train yourself. Throughout the ages and generations, countless techniques to train mana and anima were created. However, only some can withstand the test of time and validity. Like people, not all techniques are created equal, and they are subject to the same law of the jungle as we are. Only the best and most versatile can be passed on. In general, Training the mystical energies around us involves accumulation and cultivation. The techniques you see will merely be certain patterns in the way one accumulates and cultivates. Those patterns though can produce different outcomes and effects that can give one an edge in battle, especially if the technique is suited toward your element and combat style. Tell me Dirk, what's your turret now? The Duke asked, and Dirk pulled up his profile. Profile Name, Dirk Strider Species, Human. Tier, I. Rank, I. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface. I'm a Tier I and Rank I Dash. Dot. Dirk responded and closed his profile. Neither rank nor tear had advanced much. The last time he moved up was after he learned the fire and earth chore magics. Nothing has happened since then. Even after he barely learned the water ball spell two and a half years after being taught the runes, he still didn't advance again. The duke simply nodded though as if he expected it. I see. Looks like you've taken the first half step. Have you done anything special? No. I only test my control over the mana in the atmosphere throughout the days, alongside working out every day. Whenever I recover though, I do feel some of the anima seep into my body. Hmm. That's natural. Anima helps the body recover, and through recovery anima is permanently added to the body. However, that will only take you so far, and intentional cultivation is necessary to progress to great heights. Anyway, it looks like you are decently talented to be able to attain tier I at a young age. Honestly, just based on what I'm told about your work ethic I would have high hopes for you. 
Dirk tilted his head at that last part, and he faced his parents. His mother smiled at him. The Duke requested that I keep tabs on you and your progress, and I've told him about your almost obsessive physical training. Also, I'm going to ask now that you take it easier on yourself when toughening your body. It's not a bad thing to toughen bones and skin, but it shouldn't be to the point where you have purple bruises on your body every day. I understand. Hearing her, Dirk's brow furrowed. His mom knew about that? He had never let her see any of his bruises. All he was doing was kicking trees, so it wasn't like he couldn't handle himself. Toughening your body like that was necessary for some martial arts. He knew when to stop, so having bruises all the time wasn't a big deal. Still, he didn't know when she could have discovered his injuries. Could it be? Wait, blood sometimes gets on my clothes. Could she have seen that? But the maids are the ones who wash clothes. Did they tell her? Looks like I have to be more careful around Miss Sanala. She reports to Mom. Dirk made several notes in his head, and Cecilia chuckled at her son's conflicted face. The Duke continued. Anyway, you've proven yourself driven, and any more information about training methods will come from the manuals themselves. There are manuals for both mana and anima. Normally, I would only give you the mana cultivation technique, but since you've come this far, I'm thinking I'll open to you an anima manual. If it's okay with your parents, of course. The Duke looked to Riker, who was surprised. You want him to start now? It's not about what I want. He's your kid, Strider. I'm only here to give advice. While he shouldn't necessarily be brought to any school this instant, I'm thinking he can at least start comprehending the manual. He's disciplined and oddly mature, at least from what I've seen and heard. So with a little guidance, he should be able to start building his foundation. Hmm. I suppose you're right. Riker looked toward his wife, who was the expert on anima and training it. She in turn looked at Dirk. She had seen his determination and knew that discipline wasn't a problem for her child. While he was a bit unnatural in that sense, he was who he was, and Cecilia knew that he wouldn't have any problem with consistent training or dealing with pain. If even he wasn't qualified to take up a manual and simply begin learning a technique, then nobody was. Cecilia nodded to her husband. Very well. Let's do that then. All right. We'll start with the anima manual then. Smiling, the duke waved his hand. Moments later, several books flew over and landed themselves on the table. There were six. When training anima, the main effects are increased strength, stamina, speed, and durability. Some manuals focus on a single effect, while some focus on two, and some focus on all of them. Technically, you don't actually need a manual to train anima, but like I said, some have good effects down the line. Now, I know you're young, but I'll ask anyway. What effect would you wish to focus on more, if any? I would wish to cultivate all of them. There aren't any that you should go without. Dirk said after pondering a second. There was no reason you should go without any aspect should you have the ability to train all of them. If you deliberately didn't train one, you would be an idiot. I see. Then let's eliminate these. Saying that, the Duke sent away all six manuals. Then, for more flew over. These four focus on cultivating all of the benefits that anima gives. However, you should be forewarned. Training anima in general is not an easy process. It's painful and uncomfortable as you're changing your body on a fundamental level. However, using some of these manuals can make that process worse. It's not rare to see training methods that involve forcefully breaking down your body. So, if you're going to shy away from pain, then let me know. No, I won't. Really? Are you confident? I'm not sure a kid like you would have what it takes to cultivate some of these. I only do my best. I don't care how painful the method is. I want the best one. Dirk spoke to the Duke with conviction. He wasn't afraid of pain, so there was no way he would let it get in the way of him gaining strength. Doing something like that was against his very nature. Hoo hoo, all right then. You want the best? You think you've got what it takes? Here. 
screw these manuals. Let's bring out the best. Chuckling evilly, the duke threw the four manuals away and snapped his finger. The next moment, another manual flew out. This manual was a bit bigger than the others, and when it landed on the table, it sounded like a thick slab of stone. Thud. Don't tell me that's what I think it is. Riker spoke as he saw the book. Hearing him, the duke chuckled. Indeed it is, Strider. This manual is called the Animal Resonance Destruction Technique. Compared to some other manual names, it's a bit straightforward and underwhelming, but I assure you that this is one of the best techniques you can acquire besides the one that the Emperor created himself. Here, tough guy. Take a look. Smiling, the Duke pushed the book to Dirk. Sitting up, Dirk looked at the metal cover which had the title engraved on it in giant caps letters. He opened it despite his mother's frowning face. The Duke spoke as Dirk flipped through the pages. This manual focuses on gaining anima through recovery. You know how you were able to gain anima by recovering from workouts? Well this book takes that a thousand steps further. This manual is one of the most ancient training methods, and also the most infamous among the few people that actually know of its existence. It's made its reputation as the ancestor of all anima training methods as it is essentially the foundation of nearly every other training manual. It's also notorious for being the most terrifying. Its brutality is unmatched, and there are plenty of people who have killed themselves training this technique. But its effects are among the best. There isn't anything else like this one. Here, look at this. The Duke used magic and flipped some pages, stopping on a specific one. Dirk took a look at the words and spoke them aloud. Second section, Skin Destruction Technique. The skin is the membrane that surrounds your body and the first line of defense. It is also the gateway by which all anima enters your body. Using the skill displayed in the first section, one will enhance and modify the skin and its properties so as to accommodate for all further destruction techniques. To enhance the skin, one must use anima resonance specific to the skin in order to destroy sections of the skin starting from the hands and feet. The resonance must continue until red cracks appear on the section of enhancement, and only then can the resonance be halted. Once halted, allow the skin to fully recover before breaking it down once more. Continue this process until the skin no longer breaks down under resonance. Only then will it have been fully enhanced. Dirk trailed off as he looked at the diagram that was in the manual. It showed a picture of a hand, and it had all these cracks spread over it. Just the picture looked incredibly painful, and Dirk was suddenly starting to understand why this book was so infamous. This is almost sadistic. It's literally torturing yourself. But. I'm actually starting to like it. Dirk's mind started to churn. For normal people, recovery alone would take days or weeks, and who knew how long it would take to complete the whole process of enhancement. During that time, they would be vulnerable, so nobody who had a life and things to do could use this method. But Dirk had his nanobots that were just starting to be built. When they were finished, he would have excellent recovery times, more than enough to expedite the recovery process. Knowing that, he was quickly drawn to this technique. If it's as good as the Duke said it was, then he was definitely going to choose it. And while it would be extremely painful, so what? That wasn't even a factor for Dirk. Chapter 16, Man Heart After reading the section, the Duke smiled at Dirk. It didn't take a genius to realize how insane this technique was. However, contrary to the Duke's expectations, Dirk finished reading the page and nodded. This looks good. It says that once you finish enhancing all of your skin, you'll be placed in the third overall anima rank. You'll also have extremely resilient skin that's more accepting toward anima, letting you have an easier time absorbing it. Duke Hillshire, are all the sections like the skin one? Dirk asked the Duke who seemed knowledgeable about the book's contents. With a weird gaze, the Duke answered him. Each section goes through the main systems of your body like the muscles, veins, organs, bones, and even the brain. After each one, the body as a whole is strengthened the level, and you'll gain a perk related to the section. So yes, they're all similar. Hmm. I think I like it. You like it? 
This manual is basically torture, and you like it? The Duke asked with an incredulous gaze. He was beginning to think that Dirk had read something entirely different. Dirk just shrugged. It looks painful, but pain shouldn't stop you from doing anything. Why wouldn't you want to push through it and gain the strength given by one of the best training techniques? It's not as simple as pushing through pain, kid. That's half the battle. The other half is recovery, and as you climb the levels, it gets progressively worse. Tell me, while all the skin on your hands is destroyed, bleeding, and weak, how are you going to properly cast magic? How are you going to eat food? And what about your feet? When the skin on your soles is destroyed, how are you going to walk or run? You'll be sitting on your ass for weeks, and that's only for one cycle of destruction. Each section of skin takes several destruction cycles, and you have to go through all of the skin on your body. Although each cycle shortens as you gain anima, promoting faster recovery, you still have to get through that initial period of healing. Now, although you might be able to rely on your parents for healing potions to speed up the process, that can get expensive and it's up to them if they'll pay for it all. The Duke ended, causing Dirk to pause and thought. If I need to, I can go and work for any money I might need. But I don't think I would need any potions. I just graduated school, so if I can enhance the soles of my feet and my hands before I enter the academy, then I wouldn't need to worry about being unable to function. That is true but… Sigh, kid, I wasn't serious about you training this technique. Look, there are other techniques that would suit you well, so why don't we look at those? Sorry Duke Hillshire, but I feel I should train this technique. Dirk spoke outright to the Duke, his voice serious. As he thought about it more, he was increasingly drawn to the technique. It was almost perfect for him, and when he read the perks it gave for the skin enhancement, he knew that this was the one. Seeing his conviction, the Duke felt conflicted. He almost felt sorry for Dirk's parents as he seemed to have sent Dirk down the path of self-torture unintentionally. However, he suddenly thought of something. A compromise. You know what? We don't have to decide this now. Here, I'll send you home with two other training manuals as well as this one. Read them all, and in one week, let me know about your decision. Saying that, the Duke waved two other books over and set them on the table. Riker quickly agreed with the Duke's suggestion. Indeed. Let's do that. You'll have time to go over the books more and ponder. Understood. Dirk could only nod in assent. The Duke chimed in once more. And by the way, if one technique doesn't fit you, you'll be able to change it. The training methods of anima are pretty universal, so you won't harm yourself unless you suddenly switch to a different one while at a high level. That's not something you have to worry about any time soon though, so while you're young, you'll be able to try a couple and find the best fit. Understood. Good. Now we can move on to your mana training manual. Unlike anima though, once you choose one and start training it, you won't be able to change it. Especially if it's one of the advanced ones like what I'm going to show you. The methods vary wildly, and switching techniques can be extremely dangerous. So, you must choose wisely. Of course, your parents and I are here for guidance, so don't hesitate to ask questions. I understand. Then let's start. You're the fire, earth, and dark element. You also have two specialties. I'm thinking you'll be better off with a universal technique instead of a specialized one. What do you think, Strider? The Duke turned to Riker, who nodded. I agree. I don't wish to force him down any one path with a narrow technique. Very well. Here, take a look at these. The Duke waved over some more books and set them on the table. There were three, and Dirk took a look at each one. There aren't many universal techniques that can properly accommodate multiple elements. Usually people will only have two or three attributes that aren't specialized and are only basic elements. But you not only have two specialties, but the dark element as well. Luckily, universal techniques that can accommodate everything aren't incredibly rare, although they can differ in difficulty tremendously. Take this one for example. The ambient immersion technique, specialized in merging your body with the environmental mana and becoming one with the world around you. 
it's definitely one of the more difficult ones. The Duke pointed to one of the books, and Dirk went to go open it. He quickly flipped through the pages, every single one being scanned by his AI automatically. The books that the Duke placed in front of him weren't exactly short. They all consisted of diagrams and long descriptions, ensuring that the reader was able to properly understand what they would feel and how to move forward. Plus, they had to describe the technique at every tier. Excuse me, Duke Hillshire, but what's the highest tier one can attain? Dirk asked this as he closed the book. The book described its technique until tier six, and Dirk wasn't sure if that was good or bad. The Duke answered. The highest tier one can attain, so far, is tier eight. The emperor in almost every duke in this empire is tier eight. Your father happens to be a tier seven. So you, Duke Hillshire, are tier eight? Yes, I am a tier eight. I see. So why does this technique only go to tier six? That's because the creator only advanced to tier six with this technique. The duke spoke with a smile. Nearly every technique that you find will only go until tier six. From there, one usually must continue advancing the technique on their own, thereby creating their own unique technique. This can be considered one of the requisites to advance past tier six. After all, every tier seven is a unique existence, so they must have their own unique technique. You'll figure this out as you climb the tiers. For now, don't worry about it. Understood. So, what did you think about that technique? The Duke pointed to a second book Dirk had flipped through while they talked. Dirk nodded. The circle core technique is interesting. You form a magic circle within your body for each attribute, and then utilize them as cores, slowly developing them across each tier. Indeed. This one is one of the medium difficulty ones. In general, mana techniques will evolve across each tier. The techniques that have stood the test of time have found the best development route, making advancement through the tiers streamlined and surefire. With them, you won't have to worry about a step in the process not giving the correct results. Of course, this more or less only applies to the good ones. There are many other low-class techniques that will only reliably bring you to tier 3 or 4 or 5. Luckily, you won't have to worry about that. The only thing you have to worry about is picking a technique that's right for you and then sticking with it. How far you go after that depends on your talent. The only unfortunate thing that most people have to deal with is the fact that everyone has to pick their techniques at a young age. It's difficult to choose one when you don't understand your combat style personality, or skills. The Duke spoke with a sigh, and Dirk nodded in understanding. Selecting a technique based on one's combat style would indeed be incredibly advantageous. But if you didn't know where your talents lied or how you wished to carry yourself through conflict, you could only pick a technique blindly. However, there was one an obvious benefit to picking at a young age. You could develop yourself around the technique, maximizing your strengths. Luckily though, Dirk didn't need to worry about these things. He was young and knew his fighting style. Though, picking a mana cultivation technique would still be difficult. After all, he's never fought with magic. He could only make an educated guess on what he should pick based on everything he knew about himself. You don't have to decide right away though. Like your anima manual, you can take a couple home and deliberate for a while. Now, look at these for a bit while I go and grab something. The duke scratched his chin for a bit and smiled at Dirk before suddenly getting up and walking somewhere. Riker looked at him oddly. Grab something? What is he doing? Oh well. So Dirk, what do you think? Riker stood up and moved behind his son. The manuals look good, but I don't know how effective they are compared to each other. I am also unfamiliar with what goal they attempt to achieve. These manuals all train your mana. More specifically, they train your attributes. Here, listen close and let's hope you can understand this. Riker pulled up a chair next to his son and went into lecturing mode. You have three attributes. Dark, fire, and earth. To advance in tiers, you must train what's called a mana pool. Putting it simply, each attribute of yours will have a mana pool. The more you improve your mana pools, the higher your tier becomes. 
these techniques follow that logic to some extent. Like this one. You create magic circles in your body that act as cores. Since you have three attributes, you will have three cores. Then you train each one. Do you understand? Yes. Dirk answered as he processed everything. These concepts were foreign to him, but he didn't have a hard time understanding what his father was saying. Good. Now, these techniques are on mostly the same level. The Duke won't pull out any low-quality techniques. They will all get you to tier 6 rather reliably, should you have the talent of course. All you need to do now is look through the pros and cons of each one. What does each one give you compared to the other? For this magic circle one, it gives you an increased ability to handle complex magic spells. However, direct casting is much more difficult. These are the kinds of things you want to look at. If you wish to be able to easily direct cast spells, then this might not be the one for you. I see. Dirk had a bit of a light bulb moment as he understood. He then started going through each technique, carefully tracking the pros and cons of each one as well as all the details such as how long it took to train each level and the difficulty. A chart was rapidly formed with his AI, comparing the options against each other. However, before he could decide on anything, the dupe came back. All right. Here it is. Thud. A book was dropped on the table, stirring Dirk from his thoughts. The duke smiled mysteriously. This here is a technique. I got it a while ago as a gift from the emperor after your father and I cleared out a battlefield. It's been in my safekeeping for nearly twenty years, and this is one of the few times I've ever taken it out. Have a look. The duke slid the book to Dirk. The book was thick and also sported a silver metallic cover. Dirk looked at the words engraved on it. Man heart. Two simple words, but they implied so much. Dirk was immediately interested and he flipped over the cover, feeling the fancy pages within. Surprisingly, each page was totally black and seemed to be made of luxurious parchment. The letters were written with some kind of mysterious ink that glowed white, and he could even detect some mana on the pages centered around the letters. It all added to the majesty of the book. No others could compare. Dirk read. The mana heart technique is one that forms mana according to the natural systems of the body. The human heart pumps blood through the body, delivering energy and sustaining its life. Likewise, the mana heart will form a centralized heart of mana, and elemental energies will be delivered throughout the body and soul for usage. The cultivator of this technique will form one mini heart for each attribute, and will later fuse the hearts to form a single mana heart. This heart will be capable of shifting between all attributes of the user seamlessly. Only those with multiple attributes can effectively utilize this technique. Dirk started reading the book, and he couldn't seem to stop as he flipped through it continuously. Meanwhile, Riker's eyes were bulging out of his sockets. This is what you received from the Emperor after that battle? This. I don't know if this gift is priceless or worthless. Riker was conflicted about the gift. It seemed amazing, but Hillshire couldn't cultivate a different technique from the one he had began with, not to mention that he was a tier 8 who created his own unique technique. This technique was of no use to him. The Duke just smiled though. It's true that this had no use to me. However, it's still one of the best techniques ever created. I took it because I wanted to pass it on to my children. However, almost none of them are suitable for this technique. Really? That doesn't seem likely. It's true. To take full advantage of this technique, one must have multiple attributes, preferably three or more. Then you can form a stronger man heart. The book assumes that only those with multiple attributes will even pick it up. However, my children only have one or two, while those with three don't have high affinities for all attributes. After all, even two attributes is rare, forget about three or four. There are other techniques that were much more suitable for them, and using this would have been unnecessarily difficult, possibly even holding them back from their full potential. I see. But why are you offering this to Dirk? Three reasons. The Duke put up three fingers. He's suitable for the technique, he has the discipline and smarts to follow through, and he's your son. 
I'm going to offer him what I would my own children because that's what I owe you as a brother. Besides, it would be quite unfortunate if this technique never got used. I'm still trying my best, but I don't know how many more children I'll be able to have. This thing can't sit on a dusty shelf forever. The Duke chuckled merrily, and Riker smiled with him. Without words, the two stood up and gave each other a brotherly hug, smacking each other on the back. So? How is it, kid? The Duke asked as he separated from the hug, moving over to see Dirk reading the tenth page. Hearing him, Dirk snapped out of his reverie. He wanted to keep his eyes glued to the page, but he wouldn't disrespect the Duke like that. I like this technique, Duke Hillshire. Like? You seemed a bit more smitten than that. That's natural though. This technique is one of the best. My experience is lacking, but I agree that it is one of the best. Haha. -ha. You're funny kid. Well, since you like it, it's yours. However, I want you to take these two and read through them as well. Give me an answer by the end of the week, and think carefully until then. Understood. Thank you, do kill share. No problem, kid. Dirk thanked the Duke after he dropped two other books on top of the mana heart technique. Dirk agreed that he needed to read the others, but he didn't know if there was even a competition. The anima resonance destruction technique was most preferable and also one of the best anima manuals he could get. Then there was the mana heart technique. Both were extraordinary, and he wanted them both. The decision was so much easier to make than he thought it would be, but that was all right. He wasn't really one to overthink things. When all that was done, Dirk picked up the books, and the family headed out. While the books weren't incredibly thick, they were still decently heavy. Plus, the two books that Dirk wanted had metal covers. This increased their weight quite a bit, and he ended up using a good deal of strength just to carry them. When they got home, Dirk immediately took the books to his room and dropped them on his desk. He was only at the Duke's house for an hour or so, so he quickly got to reading. Chapter 17, Techniques Since Dirk had the rest of the day to do as he wanted, he didn't hesitate as he buried himself in the books. First, he decided to go through the extra books that the Duke insisted he read, just to get them out of the way. And after reading both the mana techniques and anima manuals, he nodded as if his expectations were met. They seem like watered-down versions of the best too. The Duke wasn't lying when he said that the anima resonance technique is the ancestor of all other anima techniques. They're all loosely based on the resonance technique, made to be less painful but also with lesser benefits. As for mana techniques, those all follow a system of course to some extent. And the mana heart seems to be the best implementation of that logic. He thought as he closed the last book. He then looked toward the two metal books with high expectations. While he wouldn't use the other techniques, he had documented every page just in case. His hands dove toward the anima resonance destruction technique, and the heavy cover was instantly flipped open. He read through the first section. The anima resonance destruction technique is a method by which the trainer integrates anima with his body. The technique involves taking direct control of anima and imparting specific frequencies to it. When the frequency matches the part of the body that one wishes to enhance, that part of the body is destroyed. In the process of both destruction and recovery, anima is fused with the body. This technique is based on the logic that anima is inherently rejected by and harmful to any living being's body, but only until a certain threshold, after which it becomes beneficial. This benefit is the foundation of all body refinement. Dirk read through the first section, and he felt enlightened. The book did exactly as it described. Dirk would have to take control of anima and then give it a certain frequency. In the case of the second section, which involved destroying the skin, he would have to match the anima to the frequency of the skin. The anima would then destroy the skin on every level. Through this, two things would happen. During the process of destruction, the skin that wasn't destroyed would absorb anima and become more resilient. Basically, it was like survival of the fittest for his skin cells. After that, while the rest of his skin healed, it would absorb lighter amounts of anima. After all, the body absorbed anima while recovering. 
these two processes work to infuse anima into the body. There were different frequencies in the book, and each frequency was targeted toward a part of the body. There was a specific order that the book insisted he followed though. They were as follows. 1. The skin. 2. The blood. 3. The muscles. 4. The bones. 5. The organs. 6. The brain. Each section would increase your overall rank by a whole level. Finishing the skin section would raise you to the beginning of the third rank. And at the end, when you finished the brain section, you would be put at the beginning of rank 8. Dirk was stunned seeing this. None of the other techniques would bring you so high. This one seemed to be a straight path to the top. However, that path was a tortuous one. Anyone who believed they would simply become the most powerful human by following this manual was a fool. This technique involved literally destroying yourself. The skin section was tolerable. It was merely the skin after all. Even the muscles were rather easy. But the vascular system? The bones? The organs? What were you supposed to do when enhancing the heart? If you messed up, you would easily kill yourself. The best case scenario was crippling yourself. Everything beyond the muscle section was extremely dangerous. Training this technique was not at all smooth. But Dirk was drawn further and further into it as he read. He realized that he could solve the biggest problems put forth by this technique with his own cybernetic enhancements. The only thing he had to push through was the pain. It was like this technique was made for him. Eventually, Dirk had totally documented the book with his AI. To start training this, he would have to learn how to impart frequencies onto anima, a skill the book called anima resonance. After that, he just needed to begin his cycles of destruction. He didn't decide to practice this technique quite yet though, instead jumping into the Mana Heart book. He was just as excited about this as he was about the Anima Manual. Having already read some of it, Dirk was able to quickly gain an understanding of the process. There were two main components to this technique, the Mana Heart and the Mana Lungs. These two components could actually be considered one and the same. The mana lungs were merely a technique that enabled the user to effectively intake mana from the surroundings, allowing them to accumulate. In other mana techniques, meditation was the way to intake and accumulate mana. Dirk read through the mana lungs technique. It said that its focus was intaking mana along with your breaths. Of course, this wasn't normal breathing, but breathing with the soul. However, focusing on intaking mana with your normal breathing would help with developing the technique in the first stages. Practicing this technique was actually the first step in the process. Only after you could breathe mana could you move on to accumulate your first mini heart. To develop the mini heart, one had to accumulate one of their elemental attributes in their chest. When you follow the technique, it would create something like a core of mana. You would do this for all attributes. For Dirk, he would need three. Developing these smaller hearts was the first step in raising your tier to high levels. Upon first becoming skillful with the mana lungs technique, one would saturate their body with mana until they reached tier two. Only then would they move on to form their hearts. Creating a single mini heart with one attribute would raise them to tier three. However, one would then have to create at least two more which would put them at the mid tier three range. The book didn't even make it possible for someone with less than three attributes to train this. After creating the three hearts, one would have to strengthen them, a process that pushed them to the beginning of tier four. Beyond that though was territory Dirk couldn't understand. He only knew that fusing the three hearts would come after you formed all three, but how he would do that, he had no clue. He still needed to become familiar with the first steps. Nevertheless, Dirk had already made his decision. He was going to use the mana heart technique no matter what. As for the anima resonance destruction technique, he would do his best to ensure his parents let him train it. If they didn't, he would cross that bridge when he came to it. For now, he just started to familiarize himself with the first steps of each technique. Since his nano repair bots hadn't yet been fully developed, he decided he wouldn't train the anima technique and just focus on the mana heart. He looked at the first section which described the process of using the mana lungs. 
pull in the surrounding elemental energy with each inhale and push out with each exhale. During the inhale, you should saturate your body with amounts of energy slightly exceeding your limit. This will cause a sharp pain in your mind. Upon feeling this pain, push out all the energy within your body, effectively depriving yourself of energy. This will cause feelings of fatigue, dizziness, and lower mental energy levels. Hold this state until the point of passing out, where you will then inhale all the energy once more. Repeat this process until all mental energy is exhausted. Note 1. For optimal results, the element for which the individual has the highest affinity should be utilized most. This will not affect future usage of other elements or lopsided affinity. Note 2. When the term body is used, it implies the soul. Mana is not inherently material. Dirk read the directions, disregarding that last part. He had no idea what the soul was or how it worked, but he understood what he was supposed to do. He lifted his head and stared off into space, sensing all the different elemental energies around him. Technically, his highest affinity was for the metal specialization under the earth attribute. But he decided to use the dark element since he had the most practice with it. When looking at the elements around him, Dirk could see everything perfectly. When it came to the fire, earth, or dark element, he had no trouble at all detecting each one. They appeared so clearly to him, and controlling them was as easy as grasping it with his hand. This confused him though. Wasn't his dark affinity supposed to be much higher than earth or fire? Why could he see and control the other two just as clearly? This was a question he wanted to answer, but he didn't worry about it much as he pulled in the dark element around him. It looked as if shadows were flooding to him as tons of the dark element was pulled into his body. This was Dirk's attempt at inhaling. Soon, Dirk was feeling full. He could sense a limit to the amount of energy he could withhold. Any more than this would be pushing his limits. He disregarded that though as he used his energy to pull in even more. Back! Suddenly, a sharp pain shot through his head. Dirk was caught off guard as the pain was much stronger than he thought it would be. It felt like a knife was digging through his brain, except the pain went beyond his head. He could seem to feel the soul with that pain, and he felt vulnerable. It was like he had to do everything possible to prevent damage to his soul. It was an instinct that went beyond instincts. Because of that, Dirk lost control of the elements within him. The dark energy spilled out of him unconsciously, and he felt weakened. He slumped back in his chair with a nasty headache. Damn. That hurts. He groaned a bit, though he was still shocked. It had been a long time since he had felt pain that couldn't be suppressed. He could always maintain control of himself through all forms of torment. But this was a different kind of pain. It seemed like he would have to train up his tolerance. His energy was also drained. However, that didn't stop Dirk from continuing. He had done the inhale, so he decided to do the exhale. He forced his throbbing mind to take control of the energy within him and push it out. Fire, earth, and dark energy flowed out of him, and he quickly felt devoid of energy. He didn't stop though until he was close to passing out, just like the book said. However, when he was dangerously close to giving out, his mind stopped utilizing energy, thus not expelling any more mana. This led to the mana in the surroundings to flood into his body. The feeling hit him like a truck, a mix of revitalization and overwhelming intake similar to drinking too much water. Dirk's mind became lucid again, but he struggled to maintain mental clarity. After much of his willpower was expended, he forced himself to inhale once again. Unfortunately, he couldn't bring in that much mana before he seemed to lose all his energy. His mind effectively collapsed from exhaustion, and he wanted to immediately fall asleep. Surprisingly though, he didn't give in. He suddenly pulled himself out of his chair and dropped to the floor, beginning to do push-ups. It was the oddest thing to do, but Dirk had a certain thought in mind. He needed to boost his tolerance to mental exhaustion and maintain effective combat strength during such times. If he were to fight using magic in the future, then he would no doubt become exhausted just like this. Because of that, he needed to be able to physically operate while mentally tired. His physical body wasn't impacted by mental exhaustion, 
so he only needed to get used to moving while his mental faculties were impaired. Dirk went on and did a few dozen push-ups before putting his hands on the floor to do a handstand. He kicked up into the air, but he got incredibly disoriented and fell to the floor. He proceeded to continue and try to get into a handstand, something that usually wasn't difficult, but he kept falling over and over. Finally, after a few minutes of trying, he was able to maintain his handstand for a while. He then went and walked around his room on his hands for a couple laps. Twenty minutes later, after Dirk had done some other exercises, his mental clarity returned. He still felt his head throb, but it wasn't as bad as at first. He sighed as he staggered over to his bed, collapsing on top of it before immediately falling into a deep slumber. Beep, beep, beep. Dirk's eyes flew open as an alarm rang in his mind. He had told his AI to wake him in three hours just before he went to sleep. As he crawled off his bed, Dirk was surprised to feel oddly refreshed. His head no longer had that throb, and his mind was in tip-top shape. He didn't go back to practicing the Manalong's technique though. He still needed to do his second workout of the day. After changing, Dirk left his house and jogged off to the forest he usually worked out at. In his shorts, one could see the bruises from yesterday's martial arts training. However, they weren't purple anymore, instead almost healed. These were the nano repair bots at work. Since they were only at 30% capacity, they didn't work as fast, but they were still able to heal most injuries rather quickly. Once they were at full capacity, bruises could be taken care of by the hour. This effect would only grow more effective as time passed and he grew. After arriving at the forest, Dirk proceeded to do his run. He ran 20 kilometers, exhausting himself before moving on to do more intensive workouts. He did pull-ups, sit-ups, handstand push-ups, burpees, and many more dynamic exercises. By the time he was done, three more hours had passed, and the sun was almost done setting. Dirk didn't stop though and went on to practice martial arts. He walked up to one of the trees he usually used. The bark on either side of it had been torn off, replaced by split dents. This was the tree Dirk used for his kickboxing. While this was one of the softer trees around, it was still amazing that Dirk could damage the tree to such an extent. Something like this was afforded to him who could take the pain and had hard bones. Dirk went on to continue kicking it, not stopping until his shins were basically split open. He then went and chopped at it with his forearms, bruising the bones in them. Only when his arms were purple and a bit swollen did he stop. With pain steps, Dirk jogged back to the house. Instead of entering in the usual way though, he went around the side and found his bedroom window. He then climbed up the parts of the house that protruded, entering through the unlocked window. Dirk then changed clothes before heading down for dinner which he could smell from his room. That night, Dirk went and exhausted himself with the Manalung's technique once more before falling fast asleep. The next morning, he was feeling rejuvenated. He went and worked out bright and early, enjoying the cool breeze and morning dew beneath his feet as he jogged to the forest. During the night, the nano repair bots in his body reached 68% capacity, making the healing process for his bruises pass even faster. Looking at them when he woke up, he could barely see any damage on his legs or arms. After doing his run and exercises, Dirk went back to the house with a sweaty body. This time, he decided not to do any martial arts. The reason was that today was the day that Ava came for the first time. In fact, when Dirk returned to the house, Ava had already been dropped off by her parents. He walked in on her and his mother in the backyard. Cecilia was showing her different workouts, and Ava was following closely. Upon seeing Dirk though, Cecilia lit up. She waved Dirk over. Dirk! Come over here and show Ava these workouts. Disregarding how tired her son might be, Cecilia had him demonstrate several exercises. He didn't question anything as he dropped to the floor and did what she asked. Ava though was flushed the whole time, both from how tired she was and from seeing Dirk's chiseled and sweaty muscles. Chapter 18, Nano Repair Bots After Dirk had gone through all the exercises his mother asked him to demonstrate, he stood up with shaky arms and legs. His own workout had already drained him, 
and he could barely do a few push-ups without struggle. He downed a few gulps of water from his water bag and took a look at Ava. While she had only done a few exercises, she was already sweating and gasping a bit for breath. This showed Dirk just how out of shape she was, if she had ever even been in shape before. He honestly underestimated how weak she would be. After Dirk finished up, Cecilia had Ava do more exercises. She reluctantly did as she said, dropping to the floor and barely knocking out two sets of sit-ups. After she finished though, Dirk could see her face contort. He recognized that look easily. She was about to vomit. Sure enough, she got up and ran to a bush before puking up any food in her stomach. Seeing that, Cecilia motioned to Dirk. Hey! Go help her! Help? He tilted his head. How is he supposed to help her? Should he pat her back? Cecilia rolled her eyes. Go hold her hair. Don't let any of the puke get on it. Oh. All right. Dirk just nodded before walking over. Ava was still heaving, but he didn't mind as he stroked back her hair and held it in a ponytail behind her head. Ugh. Sorry. Ava barely spit out her words. She felt incredibly shameful and embarrassed, even more so since Dirk was holding her hair. She just wanted to crawl into a hole and die. She felt like she wasn't far from death anyway with how dreadful vomiting felt. Dirk just shrugged. It's fine. Your body is shocked by the sudden exertion. A week of hard workouts will get you used to it, and you won't throw up anymore. I threw up too when I first started. He spoke from experience. Both in his life on Earth and his life here he had thrown up when first starting to exercise. Back when he was first thrown into the Super Soldier program, all the kids in his group were heaving their guts out from the exertion. He was one of them. It took about a week to get the body used to the shock, and about a month for it to get used to the stress of working out. It was the same when Dirk had first come into this world. He figured Ava would go through the same thing. It was just an adaptation period. After a month or two, one could work out freely and push their performance to its best, getting the most out of every session. Ava was silent for a long while as the horrible feeling in her stomach slowly went away over the period of 15 minutes. At first she thought the pain would never end, but as it subsided she felt much better. She staggered to her feet, and Dirk let her hair fall. Thank you. Ava felt like she wanted to cry, but she forced down her emotions and bowed a bit to Dirk. He nodded and turned, looking to his mother who was smiling a bit. All right, head into the house. Workout is over. Food is almost on the table. She waved them over, and the three walked into the dining room. They all sat down as plates were set on the table, full of meat and bread. Dirk had come to figure out that meat was the standard food in this world. The meat that was usually served at his house was similar to beef, only a tad bit more leathery. When it was cooked, they were able to make it nice and tender. Cook it a bit too much though and it became even stiffer. There was a sweet spot one had to hit, otherwise it wouldn't be nice to eat. Plus, there was the mana inside of it which made it not only taste better but also promote recovery. Besides meat though, there was also bread, which was pretty standard. Soup was also another popular meal. To top those off, there were varieties of sauces and spices, most of which Dirk had never tried before. It introduced a variety of tastes that he had never enjoyed before. Even on Earth he never got to eat anything extravagant. Dirk quickly gobbled down everything on his plate. Ava had been hesitant for a while, but she eventually just gave in and ate when she felt her empty stomach. Even after filling herself up though, she still ended up only eating a plate of food while Dirk ate five. He was getting hungrier by the day it seemed. This was by design though. Dirk stuffed himself beyond his limits so as to intake as many minerals as possible. And sure enough, as he ate he was able to feel his nanobots become active in his stomach. His body heated up, and the little amount of fat on him was stripped away. Energy was burned and food was processed as more bots were created. The process was still ongoing as he and Ava finished eating. The two got up, and Cecilia walked over. All right. 
that's your first day. Workouts will become both easier and harder over time. Mostly easier. You'll get used to stressing your body like this. However, you have to maintain a consistent schedule. This only works if you work out at minimum 7 out of 10 days. Any less, and you won't make any noticeable gains. Understood? Yes, madam. Ava nodded. While she had a dreadful time working out today, this was what she signed up for. And given her temperament, she would make sure to come work out simply to avoid scolding or judgment. Good. When we finish workouts and eat, you can head home and clean up. I know Dirk goes back out in the afternoon to exercise, but you're not there yet. Keep at it and you can start joining him. I will. Ava spoke with determination. She was shy and timid, and generally not confident, but when she saw Dirk in his stable aura, she wanted to be like that. She wanted the strength he had. She didn't enjoy being a coward. Cecilia nodded inwardly seeing that. People were forged by struggle, making themselves better. Ava at least didn't complain when she was working out. She simply grunted and fought through the best she could. While she may have been cursing in her head, telling herself that she would never do such a thing again, she was forcing herself forward. What mattered were the actions. The change in her mentality would come along soon after. With that, Ava was escorted home by one of the butlers. Dirk went up to his room to clean up, and once he had come out of his steamy bath, he laid down on his bed, beginning the man alongs technique. Dirk followed the instructions the best he could. He inhaled up until the point he felt that soul-tearing pain, after which the mana inside of him poured out. He then rode that wave, pushing out the remaining slivers of mana to empty himself. The dizziness was close to unbearable, but he was able to force himself through a little better each time he attempted this. And upon almost blacking out, the mana came flooding back in. His mind snapped back to lucidity, and he inhaled once more. This process repeated itself for two more full cycles before he could barely take it anymore. And just when the overwhelming drowsiness was going to overtake him, he dropped to the floor and did a handstand, walking around his room. This was his training cycle. He would do the manalongs technique until he had no more mental energy left. He would then do some physical exercise until the mental fatigue passed, which usually took around 20 minutes. Only after that did he go to his bed and fall fast asleep. Three hours later, he woke up to an alarm. Dirk hopped out of bed with a bit of a headache, but otherwise he was feeling sharp. Three hours was a bit short and wouldn't totally recover his mental faculties, but it was good enough. However, something suddenly happened as his sleepiness went away. Alert! Self-replicating nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems have reached full capacity. System is fully operational. Oh? Dirk's brows raised excitedly when he heard the notification. It had taken a few days, but it really did complete. Given enough materials, the bots didn't take long to replicate. Interface. Let me see my status. Constructing model. Host model. Host age, 10 years. Blood type, AB+. Skeletal structure, organic iron composite. Muscle structure, high-power compacted fibers. Sensory organs, high-density receptors. Self-replicating nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems, online. Final stand weapon system, offline. Overdrive systems, offline. Current bodily state, combat capable, 100% healthy, developing. Alert. Final stand weapon system under construction. 0.4% complete. Insufficient mineral reserves. Alert. Overdrive systems charging. 7% charged. Intelligence systems fully functional. Awaiting host orders. Seeing his status, Dirk nodded. With the construction of his repair bots, his other two systems were now allowed to come online or at least begin preparations. The repair bots did more than just repair. They stored energy and minerals for the other two systems to use. They also acted as his sensors so he could know the status of his body. They were a very versatile machine, 
and it was one of the reasons Dirk had been so combat effective in his past life. These two other systems would take time to prepare though. For overdrive, it needed to accumulate chemical energy, storing it for when he needed to activate it. This wouldn't take a long time, but it wouldn't be short. As for the final stand weapon system, that would likely take several years. The weapon system needed metals like iron, compounds like gunpowder, and lots of time to take form. While the gunpowder could be slowly synthesized over time, it would take a very long time, especially without Dirk having the needed materials on hand. Back on Earth, super soldiers like him were given capsules filled with compounds like gunpowder and other elements that they would ingest to help build the weapon system. Now though, he wasn't sure if gunpowder even existed. It would have to be synthesized by his bots slowly. With that on top of forming the metal, it could take years for his weapon system to come online. While Dirk wasn't pleased by that fact, he wasn't anxious either. He had around a year and a half before he entered the academy, which meant it could develop a lot before he was faced with any sort of threat to his life. Dirk waved away the screen in his vision before stretching his body a bit. With his bots fully functional, any sort of injury he might have had was now totally healed. His body was in perfect shape. Seeing that, he decided to go and train. Dirk jogged out of the house a few minutes later in nothing but shorts, as usual. When he arrived at the forest, he decided to try some martial arts. He walked up to a fresh tree and flung out his leg. However, he put very heavy force behind it, and when it landed, a loud thud was heard, along with a slight cracking sound. Hmm. Dirk frowned as he felt his shin bone fracture a bit. The skin was also split open. He did this on purpose. He took a look at the wound. It bled for several seconds, leaving a red streak down his leg, but the bleeding stopped soon after. Dirk could see the wound closing by the second, and soon the skin had been sealed. While one could see a cut there, it looked nothing like what it did before where one could see bone underneath. Not only that, but Dirk could feel tingling in the shin bone. His AI sent him information about what was happening, and he could see how the nanites were flooding the bone, setting it back to its original shape. Any tiny fragments that broke off the main bone were put back, and the healing process was kick-started. Until it fully healed, the bone would be sealed and supported by the bots that acted like a cement. After around 30 seconds, Dirk started jumping around. He could run, jump, and move like nothing even happened, although there was a good deal of pain. With the nanites there, moving wouldn't harm his injuries. After a few minutes of movement, a notification appeared from his AI. It said that the injury would be totally healed within four days, and the nanites would support the bone until then. His current state was fully combat capable. Something like this wouldn't inhibit him in the slightest. This was the function of his nano repair bots. It was designed to immediately solve the issues that any injuries brought him, allowing him to maintain combat ability while wounded. No matter how many broken bones or damaged muscles he might have, the nanites would repair them and restore functionality. Dirk had done plenty of operations with several shattered bones, sliced muscles, or torn tendons, but he was still able to fight because of this very function. However, he was one of the few who could push through the pain that the whole process wrought. Setting bones or repairing muscles was an excruciatingly painful process, and continuing to use those very body parts while wounded was even worse. While they were at least supplied with some painkillers on earth, that ran out fast, and Dirk never ended up using it unless the situation was dire. Even now though, he didn't have any painkillers. He would have to feel the full brunt of any injuries he got on this world. Something small like a shinbone fracture was easy to deal with though. Dirk jumped around with ease, and eventually he went on to do his workout like normal. This injury was simply used as a test to make sure his nanites worked as he remembered. The rest of Dirk's week went like normal. Every day, Ava came over and was given a workout to do under Cecilia's watch. All of them were difficult, and Ava even threw up on a few of them, but by the end she had gotten noticeably better. May a while, Dirk continued his own schedule. Wake up, work out, eat, practice the manalongs technique, sleep, work out, practice the technique again, and then sleep at night. 
This went on until the end of the week. When the final day came around, Dirk had a sit-down with his parents. Both of them wanted to know what he decided on when it came to his techniques. Dirk told them he wanted to practice the man heart technique, and that he was already making progress with it. Both parents expected this, and they nodded with a smile. They were happy that their son was already able to understand the first steps and begin practicing. However, after that came the decision on the anima technique, something they were conflicted about. Dirk was firm in his desire to practice the anima resonance destruction technique. He would never allow pain to stand in his way, and now that his nano repair bots were fully functional, he was even more confident. Of course, he couldn't convince his parents by pointing this out, so the challenge of convincing them was still difficult. Hearing his desire to train the technique, the two parents were at a loss. They didn't want him to go down such a tortuous path, and they thought that he had no idea what he was subscribing to. They wanted to guide their child, but at the same time, Dirk had shown them that he was capable of taking care of himself to a good extent. The fact that he worked out every day for nearly four years was a huge indicator of his drive and discipline, as well as his pain tolerance. He never complained about anything, and he lived with whatever he was given. He was so different from his siblings that it baffled them. But this is exactly what made them hesitate. He had never expressed his desire for something as strongly as now. Hell, he almost never expressed his desire for anything. They were at a loss of what to do. They didn't know if they should interfere under the guise of guidance or trust their child's ability. They wanted what was best for him, but figuring out what was best for your child was a hard thing to do. They also realized at this moment how little they knew about how to deal with Dirk, and how hands-off they had been with his development. Their other kids were easy, their desires and thoughts open for everyone to see. And since Dirk had always handled himself, they figured he was easy too but now they realized just how limited their understanding of their child was. These thoughts caused Cecilia to get emotional. She felt as if she neglected her child and was a bad mother for not being able to help him. Dirk saw her eyes tear up though and was confused as to why she was sad. Come with me Dirk. As his mother teared up, Riker suddenly stood and motioned Dirk over with a serious face. Dirk didn't question anything and walked with him, entering another room. All right, I'm making the decision now. Riker spoke and he faced his son. His face was conflicted but resolute. Since you want to train that technique, we'll let you. We'll make sure that you aren't hurt and can properly advance. After all, I wouldn't deserve my title as Marquis if I couldn't even help my child with his development. However, you will make a deal with me. Riker narrowed his eyes at his son, who continued to stand there strictly. He felt like he was looking at a soldier. You will promise me that you will switch techniques if you aren't confident in advancing. You will also need to let me know that you understand exactly what you are getting into before moving on to another level. The technique you are training used to be popular, but after tens of thousands of people lost their lives to it, it earned the infamy it has today. This technique is extremely dangerous, and I will force you to practice another technique if you don't understand the things you must do to train it. Am I understood? Yes, sir. Dirk spoke seriously. This was an order from his father. Riker nodded, and his face softened. Luckily, the first section of the technique is only training the skin. Should you fail, you aren't at risk of losing your life or disabling yourself, although you would be left with plenty of nasty scars. Through training the skin, you will also understand the pain brought on by this technique. Just know that it gets worse as you train it farther. Now, about your mother. Riker took on a helpless face. Do you know why your mother is sad? No. Dirk shook his head. He really didn't know why his mother would get emotional. He only wanted to train the technique. Look, I'll put it straightforwardly. You need to start showing your mother some love. When you don't, she feels like she's doing something wrong. Has your mother done anything wrong to you? No. Mother is very nice. Then you need to let her know that. And not just by talking. Tell me, what does your mother like? Hmm. Dirk went silent and thought. She liked it when she gave him hugs. 
he always saw her smile brightly when he willingly sunk into her embrace. She likes hugs. Dirk spoke with that simple conclusion. All right then. If you want to let her know that you love her, you should give her some love like how she does with you. Starting the moment you walk back into that room. Since she's sad now, you should cheer her up. Understood. Then go on. Dirk nodded before walking out of the room. Riker sighed as he followed a bit after. When Dirk walked back, he saw his mother wiping away a few tears, hiding the fact that she was crying. Seeing that, he walked over to her. Since he was still small and she was sitting on a couch, he decided to climb over and lay against her. His mother was surprised before she smiled and hugged him tightly. Dirk had never come to her for any kind of skinship before. She was elated. I love you, sweetie. She spoke softly and she stroked his back. Dirk didn't respond, only closing his eyes and letting himself be coddled. It felt weird being vulnerable, and even after all these years, he was still getting used to it. Chapter 19 Resonance From that day forth, Dirk went on to officially train the mana heart technique and the anima resonance destruction technique. In fact, that very day he went and read up on the first section of the anima technique. In his room, Dirk opened the heavy metal book. The other books had been taken by his father back to the Dukes. Dirk turned the page to arrive at the first section. The Anima Resonance Technique This was the technique whereby the entire manual was based upon. This technique would require him to make the surrounding anima resonate with the different parts of his body, something that would cause the anima to destroy it. This would both make his body stronger and increase the anima levels within him, thereby increasing his rank. The logic was that anima was inherently harmful to and rejected by the body. This was why anima destroyed the body when the two were fused. However, there was a small chance that the anima would fuse with the body and coexist with it, making it stronger. It was this small chance that paved the foundation for all body refinement arts. Without it, anima would simply be a poison that killed all living beings. After Dirk read through the first section, he decided to give things a go. The first thing he had to do actually wasn't to go straight to destroying the skin. The first part of the anima resonance technique was the foundational skill that let one absorb and accumulate anima. It said that he needed to reach the beginning of rank 2 to be capable of destroying the skin, otherwise the anima he could wield would be insufficient to do any direct harm. This foundational skill required him to control anima and flood his body with it, holding it in and letting the body absorb some. This would be sufficient to push him to the beginning of rank 2. Of course, it wasn't a painless process. The book said that he would be hit with waves of sickness and weakness after each absorption session. For those with weaker constitutions, they could be bedridden for several days after doing a single session. It was obviously a long and slow process. Dirk was still confident though. His nanites did both repair and maintenance, meaning not only would he not get sick, but any tiny wounds would be quickly healed. It could also store plenty of energy that would keep his body rejuvenated. With this, he could reach rank 2 faster than any normal person. Dirk was eager to quickly start and get to rank 2. The reason was because he wanted to finish destroying his skin before he entered the academy. It would be a reassurance to his parents if he could do that. Since that was the case, he got started right away. He followed the directions in the book and grabbed control of the anima around him. Anima appeared to Dirk as a translucent fog, like a combination between steam and heat waves. This slightly invisible liquid flowed around him constantly, just like mana. His mind grabbed a hold of the liquid, and it quickly flowed into his body. Dirk's body was like a vessel being filled as the liquid flooded every corner. With this though came a dull pain. Every single cell in his body felt like it was under pressure. He started to understand how this worked. Dirk filled up his body with all the anima he could comfortably, not pushing himself to the limit like with the mana lungs technique. This by itself didn't do much. However, the next moment, he targeted all the anima in his body and made it fluctuate slowly. This was a very light form of resonance, one that targeted the entire body simultaneously. With this came a burning and tingling pain. 
all his cells were being slightly harmed. While it wouldn't kill them all, it would definitely hurt as his body fused with some anima. Feeling this, Dirk got worried for a bit. If his entire body was being harmed, would this have lasting effects? Would his brain be injured? There were plenty of systems in his body that could be debilitated because of this. He didn't stop though. He was worried, but there was a section in the book that said nothing would be harmed should one carry out the training properly. This technique only enhanced, and besides the mind-numbing pain and recovery, there weren't any permanent prices to pay for training this technique. The book even talked specifically about the reproductive systems and how they wouldn't be affected, instead being enhanced. Dirk had initially glossed over that seemingly meaningless paragraph, but he couldn't help but think back to it as he felt the pain throughout his body. Testosterone was good for a man's growth. This was an undeniable fact. Dirk didn't want anything untoward happening to that particular system in his body, and thankfully this technique had been tried and tested, so his worries were mostly dashed. Dirk simply sat in his chair and endured the pain. It wasn't unbearable, just uncomfortable. He felt like he was getting bitten by fire ants all over. Honestly, it was only a bit worse than when he intentionally fractured his shin bone. However, he had to endure for a long time. The book told him that he should only stop when he couldn't hold in the anima anymore or if blood seeped out of any orifices. Withholding so much anima was indeed taxing on his mental energy, but he could still last for a good while. His training with Manalongs was actually starting to show its fruits even though he had only trained it for a week. When about half an hour passed, Dirk was finally starting to feel drained. However, he could still keep going. It was only until ten minutes later that he tasted blood in his mouth, causing him to instantly let the anima inside him pour out. Dirk touched his tongue, and a drop of red was left on his finger. The book said to stop when he saw blood, so he had likely reached his limit. Interface Awaiting orders What's my body look like? Scanning Dirk could feel the nanites in his body heat up a bit before calming down. The AI soon came back to him with a report. Light but widespread damage to all internal systems. Damage is microscopic in scale. Nano repair systems are currently repairing. Estimated time to heal, 15 hours. Hmm, not bad. Dirk nodded seeing that. Without the bots, he was sure that the process would take much longer. I can train this resonance technique in the morning, workout, and then continue training manalongs like normal. The resonance doesn't consume all of my mental energy, so I shouldn't have any conflicts in training. It'll just be another addition to my schedule. He smiled happily. He had been worried that training resonance would drain his mental energy, and he wouldn't be able to recover before he was supposed to train manalongs but it looked like there would be no problems since resonance didn't require that much effort. In fact, it would be a good addition to his mental energy training. Like a jog to warm up the body. With that, Dirk waited until the next day to begin his new routine. The second go-around with the resonance technique caused him to get a bloody nose, but he simply wiped the blood away before heading out to work out. Ava also still continued to work out with Cecilia since she wasn't up to par yet. Time passed and a year went by. During this time, the days seemed to pass uneventfully. Every day Dirk stuck to his training routine. He was like a robot as he did the same exact things at the same exact times. His improvement was steady and constant. Ava was also able to keep to her own schedule. The first month of working out was indeed the hardest. But after that, things got much more bearable and by the second and third month, she was already making gains in both strength and stature. Both Dirk and Cecilia were quite proud that she came as far as she did. By this time, Ava was now working out with Dirk, and she also worked out two times a day just as he did. While she still couldn't do everything he did, the two were with each other as they did similar exercises. She usually just did half or a third of what he did. Ava would arrive bright and early go and run with Dirk in the forest, and then the two would do their exercise before going back to the house and eating. Ava would then hang out with Dirk while he tortured himself with the manalongs technique, always watching as he collapsed and fell asleep for a few hours. 
then, when he woke up, they would go back out and exercise again. Seeing his routine, Ava was baffled and couldn't understand how he did what he did. Little did she actually know about the true pain he experienced on a daily basis. She just kept fighting her own battle though. Unbeknownst to her, she had come a long way both physically and mentally. She was many times tougher in the mind now, and her confidence had grown. As for Dirk, his steady advancement had finally shown results. First, after training the Manalung's technique for so long, he had finally reached Tier I+. He was now only a step away from reaching the second tier where he would be able to finally train the first section of the Mana Heart technique. With this small advancement he had actually seen an increase in his ability to control mana. He could personally cast the Spark Chore spell faster and with more reliability, same with the Sweep spell. He could also cast the Water Ball spell a tiny bit better, but that was still a hit or miss. It was just simply too difficult to cast that spell when he could barely even detect water mana. Then there was the air chore magic, Gust. This could bring in a breeze, a simple spell for airing things out. Cecilia had taught Dirk the runes, but he had yet to be able to cast it. Air mana was just like water mana in that it was hard to detect and control. He would probably take a long time before being able to cast it. Dirk didn't practice spells too much though, saving all his energy for training the techniques. Anima was actually the one that he had made the most progress in. In fact, he had actually stepped into the rank 2 level. This was the prerequisite level that allowed him to begin destroying the skin. Since he was able to heal fast, he could expedite the process of progressing through the first rank, quickly arriving at the second. However, even with his speed, it still took an entire year. He was kind of stumped by this. How long would it take a normal person? Probably a year or two longer depending on their toughness. Either way, he was now at the point where he could officially train this technique. He wasn't quite in a rush though as he had planned to do something with Ava. Since Ava had come so far, Dirk decided to do some extra work with her. The two always worked out alone now, so he didn't need to worry about prying eyes. What Dirk was planning to do was to teach her some martial arts. Ava wanted to work on her confidence and strength. Being able to fight was a huge confidence booster. The experience of fighting someone was also a confidence booster. He wasn't doing it purely for her though. Dirk had always wanted to practice his grappling, but he never had a partner. Now though, there was someone who could solve that problem. She was the same size as him and everything. And so, when the two went out to the forest and finished their run, Dirk popped the question. Hey Ava. Huff. Yeah? Ava spoke as she gasped for breath. Some sweat was already dripping down her forehead, though the morning breeze helped cool her off. Would you like to learn some martial arts? Martial arts? Yes. Dirk took a look at Ava, who was surprised by the question. Both him and Ava were now eleven years old, and they were both about to hit puberty. Ava had already started changing, her arms and legs getting thicker and stronger and her bust popping out a bit. Apparently she was also given an anima technique, and according to Cecilia, anima enhanced the body and all of its functions. Normally, a girl working out so hard for so long would make her skinny and not develop as a normal girl would, but with anima, those detriments were bypassed. Cecilia said that the same thing would go for Dirk, though he didn't have to deal with the same things as a girl. This had reassured Dirk. While his book said the same thing, knowing that anima in general wouldn't bring any harm to systems of the body was nice. Either way, Ava was increasing in strength and developing quickly. They both were. Dirk now looked like a little fitness trainer. His muscles were bulging out and his body was practically perfect. His handsome face was still a bit pale, but if anything it suited his demeanor well. Dirk had only brought the option of training Ava in martial arts because she had reached a standard. She was strong and had good stamina, meaning she could handle the work. Ava thought about Dirk's proposition. She was surprised that he knew martial arts, but didn't really question where he would have learned it from. After thinking a bit, she agreed. I guess I can do that. Okay. Then we'll start now. First, I'm going to teach you something called kickboxing. 
Dirk spoke and walked in front of her, squaring off. He then went on to explain some basics, and after around five minutes, he was training her on fundamental movements. The two did purely martial arts training for three hours, and for Ava, it proved to be no less difficult than a normal workout, maybe harder. Thankfully though, many of Dirk's exercises that they both did every day made doing these martial movements easy. After all, many of Dirk's exercises were aimed at maintaining combat ability, so if Ava were to do these, then she would be able to move the way Dirk did. By the end, Ava was heaving for breath on the ground. Dirk was standing by her, his mind going through the training they did. Suddenly though, he thought of something. I should see if I can get some weights. That would let us push our training up a level. Would they exist? Or will I have to find alternatives? He pondered and looked around the forest. There were rocks of various sizes, but they wouldn't be optimal for strength training. He shook his head and looked at Ava. She had eventually caught her breath, but as she moved to sit up, she groaned. There were some bruises on her arms, the consequences of taking some light kicks from Dirk. Training martial arts naturally meant hitting people. Ava had done many repetitions of kicks on Dirk but when he saw that she wouldn't get intense with her blows, he decided to show her how it was done. Ava was knocked to the ground several times before she finally got the hint and hit Dirk with all her strength. Dirk had even started yelling at her, forcing her to increase her intensity. After putting her under pressure, she would loudly grunt and shout with each of her kicks. Doing stuff like that was both shocking and embarrassing for her, but she got used to it after two hours. Dirk's beatings also helped her get over it. She would rather yell than get kicked by him. With that, they completed their first session. Ava still had a long ways to go, but so long as she stuck with it for a couple months, she would get the hand of everything. Her memory was already very good, so that would give her an edge when practicing new movements. The two headed back to eat after Ava recovered a bit. When they were walking in, Cecilia saw the bruises on Ava and asked about them. What happened? She fell. Ah. Uh -huh. Cecilia rolled her eyes at Dirk's response. She knew that he did his own toughness training, and he likely had Ava do some of the same training. Whatever it was, she didn't mind. Both of them trained anima, and getting tough was good for them. She knew better than anyone how cruel the outside world was. She also knew that Dirk wouldn't lead her down the wrong path. He had already taken himself so far already, so she trusted his ability. Well, eat up. It'll help you heal. Just avoid falling too hard. I don't think Ava's parents would enjoy their daughter going back with injuries all the time. Dirk froze for a second and pondered before nodding. Ava wasn't like him who could heal quickly, and her parents would have questions if she came back with bad bruises all the time. Cecilia was fine with what he did but they might not be. Thinking about this, he decided he would need to change up how he dished out motivation. The two ate plenty before heading upstairs. Ava would often go to Dirk's room and train her techniques. She had gotten a mana technique as well, so that's what she trained while Dirk did his own mana lung training. However, Dirk decided to take a look at his resonance technique this time. Dirk flipped open the book and went to the skin destruction section. While everything was documented by his AI, he enjoyed going through the book. The book was just really cool with its metal cover and seemingly ancient pages. Upon learning how to resonate anima with the skin, one only needs to concentrate the anima on the portion of skin they wish to destroy. The size of the portion is optional to the trainer, only limited by how much total anima one can control with certainty. One should only destroy the skin when they are capable of ensuring that no mistakes will ensue. However, note that the speed of advancement depends on how much skin they destroy each cycle and how often they cycle. Destroying tiny portions and recovering for long periods will not advance the trainer quickly. Destroying large portions in several different areas is optimal. Ultimately, all skin must be cycled through to reach rank 3. Dirk read through and understood what he needed to do. After practicing the resonance, he only needed to destroy the skin. However, he had options as to how he wanted to approach the destruction. He obviously wouldn't go for tiny sections. He was thinking he would do as much as he could. 
he would do enough to ensure a decent speed of advancement while maintaining his ability to do workouts. While it might take longer, he wanted to carry everything out slowly and steadily. He didn't want to mess up, otherwise his father might ban him from practicing the technique. He needed to show that he could handle the technique. Chapter 20, Destruction Slash Lifespans Dirk decided that he would attempt a destruction cycle. Learning the resonance was rather easy and only took a couple minutes, so he moved on to the hard stuff. Dirk sat at the chair of his desk with the book in front of him. Ava was sitting on his bed messing around with the man around her, training her technique. Suddenly though, Ava could see the anima around her fluctuate a bit, and she turned to Dirk. Dirk moved his hand over his forearm. He decided to destroy a section in the shape of a band going around his forearm. He could then move up and down his limbs, doing one ring at a time. After moving the anima over his forearm and concentrating it around it, he made it resonate. The anima fluctuated much faster and much more forcefully than the light resonation he did to saturate his body, and with it, he was hit with a wave of horrible pain. Arg! Dirk? Ava's eyes went wide when she heard him shout. Dirk ignored her though and concentrated on his arm. Damn! That hurts! He cried out in his mind. His teeth were gritting and his body was trembling a bit. The pain caused by the resonation made it feel like each of his cells were being burned alive. Except, Dirk had actually been burned before, and this pain was much worse than that. He couldn't understand how such pain was being caused. Except for that one shout though, he didn't make a sound. He was quiet as he trembled in his chair, his eyes slowly rolling back. Ava got worried and walked over, but when she did she was horrified. On Dirk's arm, there was a band of skin around the forearm that was cracking and disintegrating with black and red cracks. The hair had already disappeared, and now the layers of flesh were being broken and somehow skinned away. It was already raw, and the cracks were getting worse by the minute. H. Hey. Are you okay? I'm. Fine. Dirk barely spat his words out between gritted teeth. Ava just stood there, watching the skin on his arm get worse. She knew he wasn't fine, but those words told her that this was on purpose. At least, she didn't need to call for help. Yet. The process to destroy the skin lasted around ten minutes, after which Dirk stopped. He took slow breaths as the pain instantly lowered. The forearm now had a band of dark red cracks and raw skin. One could even see some of the muscle underneath. It looked like someone had burned the skin with a torch and then skinned the charred surface. It was not pretty. As he was calming down though, Dirk suddenly shot out of his seat and ran to the bathroom. Ava could hear the sounds of vomiting not long after, and she ran over. After going inside though, she stopped, looking at Dirk who was trembling while hugging a toilet bowl. She remembered how he would hold her hair back when she was throwing up and wanted to do the same for him, but he didn't have long hair to hold. After a second or two of thinking though, she kneeled next to him and rubbed his back in an attempt to comfort him. After several minutes, Dirk finally pulled away. He took slow, controlled breaths as his body regained its calm. Are you okay? Ava asked again, and Dirk nodded. Yeah. My body isn't used to intense pain and it was shocked a bit. I'll be fine. Dirk spoke as he looked at his arm. Back on Earth, he had plenty of experience with pain and knew how to push through it. Here though, his body hadn't experienced that yet, and he needed to teach it how to suppress instincts like throwing up. Not to mention, this pain was arguably worse than anything he had ever experienced. Luckily, this destruction and torture was a good tool to increase his tolerance. He could get used to pain again. Interface. Awaiting orders. Check my wound. Dirk gave a command to his AI. Every injury was automatically detected and dealt with, but he wanted a report on this new kind of wound. Unknown classification of wound around the forearm, similar to burns and radioactive destruction. No signs of random mutation. No risk of cancer. Nano repair bots currently sealing and promoting healing. Estimated time to heal, 6 to 9 weeks. Note 1, intake of nutrients recommended to help promote healing. Note 2, 
Anima assisting in promoting healing and repair. Note 3. Recommend acquiring medical serums to accelerate healing process. Ha, huh, so you know what Anima is. Dirk pondered seeing the notes. It surprised him that the AI could detect the Anima's involvement in healing. The second surprise was the time to heal. Around two months wasn't bad, but it was still quite a while. It looked like the destruction dealt thorough damage, and Dirk wouldn't be able to move as quickly as he thought. He doubted if he could destroy all his skin before he entered the academy. Well, getting done my feet and hands will be good enough. Then I won't be kept from doing anything. Though, I don't think I'll be able to get any medical serums to help with the process. He sighed when he thought about the serums. Back on Earth, the Nainites had supplies of serums to take care of anything. Some serums would protect his body from chemical attacks, and others would accelerate healing. However, he didn't have any of that now, and he was sure that this world had nothing like the serums. He didn't know where to even start in finding something that could help him. Em, do you need anything? I can go get you water. Ava asked. She knew that throwing up wasn't pleasant, and getting a bit of water in one's stomach could help with recovery. Dirk thought a bit before nodding silently. I'll be right back. Seeing him agree, Ava got up and ran out of the room. Dirk also staggered to his feet, going over to his bed and taking a seat. He meditated a bit so as to take control of his body. A minute or so later, Ava came back in with the Boda bag that he usually used while working out. However, it wasn't just her that came walking in. Cecilia followed behind her and took a look at her son. Cecilia walked over and saw the wound that wrapped around his arm. Having never actually seen a wound caused by the resonance technique, her face dropped upon seeing how horrible it was. The things she heard about how painful the technique was combined with the sight of it told her that it must have been excruciating. However, this also surprised her. Not only did she not hear any yelling, but Dirk was currently sitting calmly on his bed. Was it not as bad as she had heard? Ava told me you threw up. How's the wound? Cecilia asked as Ava handed Dirk the bag. He took a few gulps of water before answering. It hurt, but I'll get used to it after a couple more destruction cycles. I'm thinking about targeting my hands and feet soon so I can make them stronger before the academy. I see. Hang on. After making a decision, Cecilia turned and walked out of the room. Dirk watched her in confusion and drank some more water. Ava stood to the side and couldn't help but stare at the wound. She wondered if she could handle something like that herself. A few minutes later, Cecilia walked back in. In her hands was a brown case, and she set it on Dirk's desk before popping it open with a click. Dirk looked over and could see several flasks of liquid inside. She looked through the rows before picking one out and moving over to Dirk. This is a potion that can accelerate healing. Drink it, and that wound should heal up in about half of the time. Here. Saying that, Cecilia handed the flask to Dirk. The flask was made of glass, and Dirk could see a green liquid roiling around inside. He accepted it before taking off the cap and sniffing it. H.M., it doesn't smell so bad. Almost like tea. Surprised, he put the flask up to his mouth and downed everything in one go. When the liquid reached his stomach, his body started to heat up, and he got an alert from the AI. Alert. Healing substance detected. No harmful chemicals detected. Isolating substance for storage and direct application to wounds. Dirk looked at the notification and nodded inwardly. This was how the AI handled medical serums from Earth. All he would need to do was ingest it and the Nanites would absorb the serum, storing it for when he needed it. When he later got wounded, it would apply the serum directly to the wounds, making use of it in the most efficient way. It seemed like it could do the same thing with this mysterious potion. Dirk was pleasantly surprised as the Nanites ferried over the potion to the wound on his arm, applying it and allowing the accelerated healing to occur. One could see the raw skin on his arm turn slightly green, a result of the potion being released into his blood vessels and cells. Cecilia sighed. The next time you do a cycle, just be careful, okay? Especially when you do your hands and feet. 
let me know when we can prepare for it. Oh, you can take this potion too. It'll help with the pain. She plucked out another potion, handing it to Dirk. This one was white, and Dirk didn't say anything as he drank it all too. At the same time, he gave a command to his AI. Interface, isolate the potion. It's a painkiller. Store it and don't administer it. Affirmative. Isolating painkiller potion and commencing deep scan of substance. With that, Dirk felt the liquid in his stomach disappear, none of it being infused into his system. He didn't need a painkiller, nor did he want it. He could save it for when he absolutely needed it. After Dirk drank the potions, Cecilia sighed. She didn't like how her son was walking down this path, but she had reluctantly agreed with her husband to let him at least try. If the time came where he couldn't handle it or he messed up, then she could try and get him another technique. That was the nice thing about anima techniques. One wasn't 100% locked in when they trained one. Seeing how Dirk wasn't in pain, Cecilia left with the box of potions. She could only wait until the next time he did another cycle. She already made a mental note to ask her husband to bring back some more potions. They had planned to already, but Dirk started faster than they thought. After she left, Dirk took another look at his forearm. Normally, a wound like this would leave a hideous scar. While he didn't particularly care about scars, he had to destroy all of his skin. He didn't want to come out of this looking like a monster. Luckily, the recovery promoted by Anima would erase scars and blemishes. Anima really makes things easy. Only, if the pain is supposed to get a lot worse every level you advance, I wonder how bad it will be at the later levels. It's already enough to hurt me pretty bad. I don't really want to imagine how bad it is when one destroys their bones. Dirk slightly shivered at the thought of pain many times worse than what he just experienced. Sure he was tough and wouldn't let pain stand in his way, but that didn't mean he enjoyed getting hurt. It still sucked, and sometimes he wondered if tough minds were a curse rather than a blessing. All right then. Time for mana lungs. He spoke and got comfortable on his bed. Meanwhile, Ava was stunned. You just tortured yourself with one technique, and you want to do the same with another? Did he even feel pain? She was starting to doubt if he did. Dirk didn't think much about it though. Things didn't change just because of something small like a destruction cycle. The only thing he did was rearrange his schedule. He no longer needed to do light resonance every day to increase his rank, but he couldn't do a destruction cycle every day either. He would just have to plan out what areas he would destroy and when he would destroy it. There was one other problem though, and that was his martial arts workouts with Ava. He couldn't quite start destroying the skin on his feet or hands as that would make practicing with Ava almost impossible. He wasn't keen on stopping the training he just started, so he decided he would just hold out on doing his hands and feet for a few months while they trained. He could always work on other areas. After that day, Dirk continued to go on with his schedule as normal. He and Ava would train martial arts every day, and she got progressively more proficient. Her kicks were fiercer, punches were sharper, and Dirk even trained her in grappling, so she was able to do several different movements. After a few sessions, Ava also learned how to be intense with her blows, hitting with the intent to harm. She had been hesitant at first, and it took many beatings from Dirk to pull that ferocity out of her but she was eventually able to do so herself. Dirk had effectively taught her how to be mean. This took time though. Dirk trained Ava for 10 months. Those 10 months though were enough to transform her into a totally different person. Now, Ava could yell, she could hit, she could be mean, and she learned how to stand with her shoulders back and head high. The shyness and pushover attitude she had in school was no longer there. Well, not totally at least. There was only one person that she was meek around, and that was Dirk. Ava had learned how to be tough in these ten months, but she had also learned how terrifying Dirk could be. His ability for combat and sheer force of will had baffled her many times over, and she knew she may never be able to catch up to him. It was unreal for a kid such as him to have what he did, but she didn't care how he came to be that way. All she knew was that he could put her on her ass with ease and no remorse but she was okay with that. 
It was tiring, being tough. Sometimes she just wanted to be able to follow someone and be in their shadow, and Dirk was that perfect person. With him, she could simply listen and follow directions. He was direct, calm, and stable. She enjoyed that, albeit unconsciously. Besides martial arts, Dirk also went on to do some destruction cycles on his feet and hands. He had waited around five months, and in that time he did destruction cycles on his arms and abdomen. Each time, the area destroyed was large and the process was extremely painful. Cecilia had been horrified when she saw Dirk's entire abdomen cracked and raw. It almost looked like he had been gutted. Ava almost gagged at the sight as well. It had to be done though, and Dirk merely gritted his teeth. Each time he did a cycle, the pain got more bearable. And with the potions his parents gave him, he was able to shorten the healing time to about three weeks. He was also able to figure out how many cycles were necessary to complete destruction. In the case of his abdomen, Dirk had to destroy the skin four times over. The first time was the worst, but each time after that the pain was dulled. Since some of the skin was enhanced each time, the later cycles would destroy less and less. By the fourth time, Dirk only had a few cracks and tender skin. It only took a week to heal from that one. It was the same for the rest of the sections he destroyed too. Things would get progressively better after each cycle, making it rather easy on him. However, there was a lot of skin to destroy, and healing still took a good deal of time. While he wasn't restricted to only one section of skin at a time, he wanted to be able to function normally. This meant he only destroyed skin on one side of his body at a time so he could sleep without too much discomfort. He also couldn't destroy the skin of entire limbs otherwise he wouldn't be able to practice martial arts with Ava as well. Plus, his mother would get worried if he did too much, so he held back some. With all that, Dirk had destroyed the skin of his abdomen, arms, and the tops of his thighs in these ten months. During five, he had also decided to destroy the skin of one of his hands. Then on month seven he destroyed the skin of his other hand. By month ten, he had finished both his hands and was almost done with his left foot. Those months with only one hand to use was not fun. While he was pretty much ambidextrous, only having one hand was severely limiting. It was difficult to open things, and practicing with Ava became more challenging. It was like fighting her with an arm tied behind his back, something he actually had to do since he would occasionally grab her with the destroyed hand out of reflex. The feeling of raw and cracked skin pulling on fabric felt fantastic. He was pretty sure he pulled off a layer of skin doing that. Luckily, those days had passed. Not luckily though, he was now struggling to live normally with a destroyed foot. This was where he was at on month 10. Do you need me to dash? No, I'm fine. Dirk put his hand up, interrupting Ava. They were in his room, and she was offering to help him move downstairs to eat. Ever since he had done cycles of destruction on his foot, she had done some caretaking. It was the same when he was down hand. She just helped out where she could to make things easier for him. And while he appreciated it, he didn't really like being taken care of. He would make it work one way or another. Dirk launched himself off the bed and landed on his right foot. He then hobbled out of this room and down the stairs to the dining room. Ava followed closely behind, watching out in case he tripped so she could catch him. He soon got down to the kitchen and sat himself down. After Ava sat with him and food was served, Cecilia came walking in. The academy will be accepting in two months. Are you ready? She asked with a smile. Dirk was the last child to leave the house for the academy, and in these years prior, he had done a lot that would give him an edge. His physical fitness was unmatched, his pain tolerance was unbelievable, and he currently trained two of the best techniques in the world. Seeing how he was also ranked two, his progress proved to be quick. None of her children had ever been so ready to enter the academy, so Cecilia was very excited to see her son enter. If it had been up to her, she would have sent him two years ago. Dirk nodded as he stuffed some meat into his mouth. I'm not sure how much more I can prepare. If I had knowledge about what they did there, then I could do more. Don't worry, that question was rhetorical. You're definitely ready. What's your tear at? 
How has training your man heart technique been? Cecilia asked, and Dirk thought for a second before his profile popped up. Profile Name, Dirk Strider Species, Human Tier, I+. Rank, 2 Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92% Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes Pure soul. Skills, AI interface, grade 7. He looked at his status and nodded. Having destroyed a lot of his skin, his rank was halfway to rank 3. He had also never skimped on his mana lungs training, but that progress was slower and he had yet to reach tier 2. He could feel close though. He felt like he was on some kind of cusp, and he knew it wouldn't be long before he reached the next tier. I'm at tier I. Plus. My training is slow but steady. Training mana isn't a quick process. It's important to make sure your foundation is solid at each level, otherwise you'll be more prone to failure. A mistake while training or advancing could end your career or life, so never rush things. Understood. Good. You know, Rita is very excited to see you. They've all grown up, and you'll be the last one to enter. Let's see, Rita is 16 and you're going to be 12. Ethan is 18, and Viola is 20. Half my kids are grown-ups. Gosh, I feel old now. You growing up makes me feel even older. Cecilia spoke nostalgically, though Dirk didn't understand why she felt that way. From the time he was born to now, he had never seen Cecilia age at all. She looked like a woman around 28 years old, and not a year older. He didn't even know her actual age. Mother, how old are you? Are you really asking me my age? Cecilia narrowed her eyes at him a bit after he asked his question. Seeing that, Dirk shook his head, causing her to chuckle. Hoo hoo, fine, I'll tell you. This year I turn 61. Your father is also 86 I believe? He's an elf hybrid so he ages even slower than I do. Sometimes I get a little jealous of his hair. It's so much silkier than mine. And then he has the audacity to cut it short. Cecilia complained a bit, but after hearing her age, Dirk was stunned. Sixty-one years old? His father, who looked no older than thirty, was eighty-six. They should be getting wrinkles and white hair around that age. How did they still look twenty-five? Dirk sat there staring into space attempting to figure out how that was possible. Cecilia saw his conflicted face though and answered his question. The higher power you achieve, the slower you age. Anima, especially, slows your aging to a great degree. I doubt your father will keel over for another five hundred years. And while humans don't have such natural lifespans, someone like me will easily live for four hundred. I shouldn't see gray hairs until I'm 300. Even then though, your father will still look young. I'm thinking I'll have to drag him to the grave with me when my time comes. Can't have him touching other girls out of loneliness. Cecilia frowned as she ruminated about the future. Meanwhile, Dirk was stunned even more. He had a hard time wrapping his head around the concept of living for hundreds of years. One could see civilizations rise and fall during that time frame. It was a surreal thought. Chapter 21, Stigma Slash Academy This is your last one? Yeah, I think so. That's good. Any more and you would have a hard time getting to the academy. Ava smiled as she spoke with Dirk. They were currently in his room, and Dirk was preparing for a destruction cycle. Two more months had passed, and Dirk had finished his left foot. Now, he was on his right and hoping he would only have to do one more cycle. After getting comfortable on his bed, he started. He moved the anima over to the skin and began the resonation. The skin started to redden, and five minutes later there were a few shallow cracks. That was it though. Even continuing more, Dirk couldn't feel anything. The rest of his skin had been cycled through and wouldn't be destroyed under the resonation. He smiled seeing how little damage there was. Something like this could heal in a few days. Not only did Anima toughen and strengthen his body, it also made it recovery faster. 
something that took a week now only took four days. This combined with his nanites and the potions he was fed made recovering very convenient. Looks like you'll be able to walk. Ava also nodded seeing the light damage. She had almost always been there to watch his cycles. She also saw how he became tougher after each one. The first cycle he trembled and had to vomit. But now, he could push through a first cycle with a mere grunt and frown. This kind of tenacity was insane to Ava. After finishing the cycle, the AI moved the nanites to seal and began repairing the wounds. The sealing made it so that nothing would get infected and the skin would be supported, preventing any more tearing. The AI had actually come to learn how to better handle Dirk's destruction wounds over time, optimizing the repair process. Though Dirk wasn't really aware of this. Seeing how the sealing was done, Dirk took the medical wrap next to him and wrapped his foot. This was more for show as his mother had ordered him to wrap his wounds to prevent infection. He didn't need to with his nanites, but he didn't really have a choice. He didn't mind though. It at least made things more comfortable. As he wrapped his foot, Ava stared at him for a bit before speaking. I won't be coming tomorrow. My parents need me to prepare for entering the academy. All right. Dirk simply nodded. The day to officially enter the academy was the day after tomorrow. Dirk obviously wouldn't insist that she arrive for training. He was surprised that she even came today. Will, we be seeing each other there? I don't know. I'm not even sure what we'll be doing there besides learning magic. Dirk shrugged. He didn't know much about the academy, let alone whether he and Ava would be seeing each other. He assumed they probably would since the place was only so big, but how often was a different question. Ava thought for a second before speaking. Well, I'll be looking for you. Depending on our schedules, we can keep training. Hmm. But in case we don't see each other, you should take the training by yourself when you can. I know you train anima, but you still lose stamina fast. You shouldn't have more than three day gaps between training. Just do the workouts we would normally do and you'll be fine. All right. But what about martial arts? That? I'm not sure. It's hard to train without a partner. Just work on fundamental striking movements and that should keep you sharp. The knowledge of martial arts movements don't go away so easily, and many movements should be reflex for you now. Ava nodded hearing that. Dirk's training had firmly engraved many fundamental techniques into her bones. She was capable of reacting properly on pure instinct now. Those instincts wouldn't wash away so easily, and doing fundamentals on her downtime would keep her refreshed. Just make sure not to forget your training. When the time comes for you to really fight someone, you need to keep yourself calm and use the moves you've been taught. I understand. It's not like we're going to war though. Ava brushed off his words a bit. Dirk shook his head though and spoke firmly. That's irrelevant. Two years ago, you were a timid mess incapable of standing for yourself. You had no knowledge or skills that could keep you safe and secure. Now, I've trained you to be strong in body and mind. No matter where you're at, you must be strong. In all situations and in all decisions, you must be strong. Wield the strength that you've earned, otherwise it will be washed away by the people and environment around you. Am I clear? Crystal. Ava answered strictly, something she had been taught to do by Dirk. The next moment though, she thought a little more deeply about his words. She looked back and realized how far she had come. Her first day of school, she had struggled to even enter a classroom. Now, she was capable of holding her own in any conflict, and her confidence was high. She was no longer so self-conscious. It was as if she were a totally different person. Wield the strength that you've earned. Be strong in body and mind. Don't let it be washed away by the people around you. These words engraved themselves in her psyche, and she became a bit emotional. Dirk had given her a chance, and she had worked so hard. She didn't let him or herself down. She couldn't imagine where she would be if she hadn't met him. The thought of going into the academy and the outside world as a timid girl incapable of defending herself scared her, and she understood how priceless such a transformation was. Her eyes reddened a bit, 
and her mouth trembled as she spoke. Can. Can we hug? Hm? Dirk's eyebrows raised a bit at her question, and he realized she was getting emotional. He didn't really understand why, but she was a girl, and like with his mother he stopped questioning why. Thinking about it, he just nodded and stood up. He had taught her to ask questions outright, and if it were just this, he didn't mind. Seeing him agree, Ava moved in. The two hugged deeply, and Dirk could hear some light sniffles. Ava was shorter than him, so her face was buried in his chest. He wondered if he would have to wash his shirt. The two were like that for almost a minute as Ava calmed down. Eventually they separated, and she wiped her eyes. T thank you. Sure. She backed away with a red but content face. Dirk nodded before going back to the bed and beginning his man along training. Seeing him, Ava also sat on the bed and did some meditation. Though, she couldn't concentrate much as she thought about the future and what she would do if she didn't see Dirk anymore. Also, Dirk's effect on the surrounding mana was rather intense, making meditation difficult. Dirk didn't care though as he simply breathed in and out. By now, he was capable of dozens of breaths. Mana lungs was beginning to become more like actual breathing, the mana around him flowing freely from the environment into his soul and back out again. When he first started, Breathing into the limit caused soul-tearing pain, and breathing all the way out would cause him to almost faint. But now, breathing into the limit only caused a dull pain, and breathing all the way out didn't make him so drowsy. He knew that his soul had gotten tougher, so as he pushed himself more, he became capable of doing the technique easily. Dirk seemed to be breathing mana normally for several minutes. Each time he breathed in and out, he felt like he could contain a tiny bit more mana than before. However, he had yet to actually step into Tier 2. He had felt like he was on the edge for almost a year now. It was getting a bit frustrating not advancing. Maybe I just need to practice this more. Since it's getting easier, I should try training throughout the day. Can't get better if I don't push myself. With that conclusion, Dirk continued to breathe. He wanted to be able to breathe mana just as he breathed air, so he set his new goal and worked on it. Please don't tell me you're actually going to work out. Do I not have time? Just relax, child. You can survive a day without training. We leave in two hours. Oh, and don't do any mana training either. You'll need to be in good shape for the test. Cecilia spoke as she shook her head. Today was the day that Dirk officially entered the academy. Initially, he didn't really mind that as he prepared to do his morning routine. His mom stopped him though, baffled that he would still think of such a thing when today was a big day. Hearing her, Dirk reluctantly returned to his room to wait for the two hours. In there, he decided to do some light exercises to get his blood flowing and pass the time. Nothing that would make him that tired, of course. He also did a few minutes of mana breathing. When the time to leave approached, Dirk dressed in a formal casual set of clothes. He had come to greatly prefer clothes that he could move around in as he never liked being restricted. Plus, he didn't have any formal clothes that fit him since he had grown so much and had no need for them. After dressing, Dirk went down to the entry hall right when he was supposed to. Cecilia was already there and nodded when she saw him. Dirk was always very punctual. The two then quickly boarded the carriage and drove off. Dirk, what tear are you now? While they were riding through the busy streets, Cecilia asked him. Dirk quickly answered. I'm still tear I plus dot. I see. Now, I'm not exactly worried about this happening soon, but I think I'll let you know about it anyway just in case. There's a certain thing that mages and warriors eventually come to form after rising in power. It's called a stigma, and you can think of it as a unique tool that's formed from the soul. It's rather rare to form one but I have actually formed it, as has your father. This is my stigma. Saying that, Cecilia raised her hand. In it, a saber mysteriously appeared out of thin air. The saber was solid gray, but Dirk had a hard time seeing where the blade was located. It was like it did and didn't exist. Stigmata can come in many forms. Your father's stigma is that magic book you always see him carrying. 
A stigma can also be a cloak, an alchemical flask, a shield, a bow, a forging hammer, or a magic staff. There is no definite rule to what a stigma can be, and we only have general ideas about how they are formed. Generally, talented people begin to form their stigma around tier 4. People who aren't talented won't form one at all, and they also don't tend to rise high in tiers. Warriors can also form a stigma after reaching a high enough rank. Again, the rules to form one aren't well defined, but it's agreed that only talented people will be capable of forming one. And you, my child, are a talented boy. Cecilia ruffled Dirk's hair proudly. You have three attributes, two of which are specialized. Most people only have one attribute, and it's rare to get two. Three is even rarer, and a four-attribute mage is something you may only hear about once in your life. You are a three-attribute mage, so you automatically have some talent. Should you develop smoothly, I have no doubt that you'll form a stigma of your own. Just know that if you begin to feel anything weird in your soul and start to feel an image take form, then it's likely you're stigma forming. I'm not sure when it'll be for you, but you could very well form it after reaching tier 3. Or rank 3 if you get there first. If you have any questions, you can also ask your father. After all, he'll be at the academy. Understood. Dirk memorized all the words she said. This stigma thing sounded interesting, but he hadn't yet felt anything taking form. It looked like he would have to give it time and simply keep an eye out. The next moment though, he thought of something. What was his mother going to do while he was gone? Was she going to stay in the house by herself? Mother, what will you be doing after I enter? Me? I've been thinking about that recently. I might just go live with your father in the academy since that's basically become his home. HM, I still have to take care of my plants though. I don't know. I'll have to think about it more. All I know is that you probably won't be seeing home for a long while. Your siblings all live in the academy, except for Viola who has gone off on her own dungeon expedition to further her power. I believe Ethan is also joining the military, so he'll be leaving soon. There isn't much for you back home anyway. Everything you need is in the academy. Cecilia hugged her son as she said that. She was both happy and sad that he was moving on. She was mostly excited though. Her son couldn't be more ready, and she looked forward to what he achieved in the future. Soon, the two arrived at the plaza outside the academy walls. The place was filled with people, all of them parents and children who were entering. Dirk and his mother exited the carriage and walked into the plaza. They kept an eye out for Riker who was supposed to come get them. Dirk! Ah! What the? Dirk's head snapped around when he heard a shrill shout. He could see Rita running toward him, but as he watched her approach, his pupils contracted. Occasionally as she ran, she would suddenly disappear in a black fog and reappear a few meters away. She did this consecutively to weave through the crowds of people, and Dirk almost threw out a punch when she teleported almost right in front of him. It took all his self-control to refrain from doing anything as she dove into him. Ah! Look how big you've gotten! Oh, and strong! How are you? Rita hugged him tightly while he stood there and took it. Seeing how much Rita had grown, Dirk could only smile. Rita was now sixteen and a bit taller than Dirk. She was a slim but developed girl with a stunning face and gorgeous black hair that seemed to be illusory. Also, he could feel intense power from her. Seeing through his mana sense, she simply looked like a dense ball of chaotic dark energy. He didn't know what happened, but she had become seriously powerful since he'd last seen her. After evaluating her progress, Dirk smiled a bit. I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. Very good. You are going to love the academy. I'm already tier 5. You also have perfect affinity for the dark element. Suddenly, a deep voice came from behind. Rita turned around to see her dad smirking at her. Oh, hi dad. Ah. Uh -huh. What did I tell you about void walking in public? To not. Yeah. You haven't mastered it, so don't go zipping around all over the place. I'm good enough though. 
I at least won't hit anybody. Rita spoke with a bit of injustice. Riker just shook his head. I don't care. Spatial magic isn't your forte and it's not a joke. A single slip and you'll kill someone with a spatial ripple. I understand. Rita's mood was dampened under Riker's scolding. He just rolled his eyes at her and turned to his son. Are you ready, kid? From today onward, you'll be a mage and body refiner. They train both in the academy, so you won't be missing out on anything. Yes, sir. Dirk answered with a bit of excitement. He had been looking forward to this day for a long time. All those days of slogging through school was for this very moment. All right then. Since you're my son, you won't have to worry about getting in line and going through all these procedures. Before that though, say bye to your mother. You might not see her for a few days. Bye mom. Dirk nodded and turned around, giving his mother a hug. She hugged him tightly before letting him go with a kiss on the forehead. Okay. Follow me you too. Riker walked off, and Dirk and Rita followed him. Cecilia watched them walk off for a bit before turning around herself. Taking a step, darkness enveloped her and she disappeared. After walking off, Riker took Dirk inside the academy. They walked straight through the gates and off to a large building that looked something like a gymnasium. After walking in, they were greeted with a small crowd of people. There were several different stations with short lines behind them, and children around Dirk's age were all getting tested for something. This is the testing area. All your information is already processed, so you only need to get tested for your ability to control mana. All you need to do is place your hand on the ball and inject mana into it. Reach a certain threshold, and you'll be cleared. The farther you go, the better your rating. Though, that doesn't particularly matter for you. You'll be put into the class I've set aside for you anyway. Now go ahead and wait in line. Understood. After Riker patted him, Dirk went over and got in one of the lines. None of the kids talked to each other as they stepped up to the table one by one. The atmosphere was tense for them, but Dirk didn't particularly feel nervous. He was rather confident in his ability to control mana. Eventually, Dirk stepped up to the table. There was a man who looked to be in his fifties behind the table, though with Dirk's new knowledge about lifespans, he couldn't tell how old he was. He could be four hundred years old for all Dirk knew. What's your name? Dirk Strider. Strider. All right. Twelve years old, Terai Plus. Okay. I want you to put your hand on the ball and inject your mana into it. Simply sending it through the ball will do. The more mana you stream into it, the higher your rating. Do as much as you can, but don't hurt yourself. As long as you reach the minimum you'll have passed. Any questions? No. Then put your hands on the ball and start when you're ready. After shaking his head, Dirk looked down at the crystal ball near the edge of the table in front of him. The ball had slash marks on it, and each mark had a different number next to it. The bottom slash had the number zero on it, and the slashes numbered up to ten which was at the top of the ball. It looked like one had to literally fill the ball with mana. The stand that the ball was on also had I plus engraved on it, probably signifying that this ball was used for those who were tier I plus. Dirk didn't think too much though before putting a hand on it and sending through some mana. The element he chose was the dark element, and after it entered the ball, black liquid appeared and filled some of the ball. It looked like he was dumping water into it. Seeing how this worked, Dirk finally went full force. The ball seemed to consume his mana and convert it to this liquid, so he simply had to feed it to increase the level. He dumped copious amounts of mana into the ball, and it quickly surged past the halfway mark. To the side, Rita was watching with gleaming eyes. In her vision, the dark element around Dirk was flooding into him and being sent into the ball. She had never seen such a technique, and she wondered how he could so fluidly bring in mana like that. If she attempted that, her soul would scream in pain. Meanwhile, Dirk started to feel fatigued after pushing the liquid past the number 9 mark. He didn't let it bother him though as he utilized the mana lungs technique to pull in and push out mana. 
The technique was very efficient, and soon enough, he had totally filled the ball with that black liquid. When the ball didn't accept his mana anymore, he stopped and pulled his hand away. He still had a bit of energy left in him too. Wow. All right then. Congrats Dirk Strider, you've earned a level 10 grade. Go ahead and step to the side. Understood. Thank you. Of course. The man behind the table nodded to him with surprised eyes. Dirk simply stepped out of line as the ball on the table drained of the black liquid, leaving no evidence of the previous result. Chapter 22, Tour Hey! How did you do that? After Dirk returned to his father and sister, Rita exclaimed and pointed to the table he came from. Dirk shrugged nonchalantly. I just fed it with mana. And do you not feel tired at all? It took most of my energy, but not enough to make me pass out. Well that's insane. I know you're only a tier 1, but... Your sister was only able to get a 9 on her test, and it took everything she had. After snapping out of his surprise, Riker spoke. The minimum to pass is 5, and that's also where a significant portion of students land. I would say that 60% of students land between 5 and 6. The rest are dispersed between 7 and 9. Only the topmost can reach 10. Even then though, it's not guaranteed to see someone reach 10 every year. We might see a few in a 10-year time span. I didn't expect you to be able to reach it. Good job. Riker patted his son's shoulder. Meanwhile, Dirk was surprised about how difficult it was to get a 10. Also, he was surprised by the fact that he still had energy. If he really pushed himself, he might be able to go to an 11 or 12. This made him wonder if reaching 10 was actually that impressive. He couldn't believe that people would have such a hard time getting a high number. He had passed number 6 with but a thought, only utilizing his technique to push higher. Despite having achieved something impressive though, Dirk didn't think much of it. He knew how far away he was from someone like his father. His mother was the same. Dirk was still a weak, helpless child. He wouldn't get an inflated ego just because of a small success like this. When Riker saw that his son didn't even get a bit excited over his impressive feat, he chuckled a bit and shook his head before walking over to the man at the table. After an exchange of words, the man handed Riker the sheet with Dirk's evaluation on it. All right, we're done here. Congratulations, Dirk. You are now an official student of the Academy of Magic. I've already entered you into your classes, and all your school items are at your new residence. How about we head over there? Saying that, Riker turned and led the three out of the gymnasium. After walking a bit, they came upon an area to the side of the school. This place had large rectangular buildings that looked not unlike apartments. They were rather nice and tidy. Of course, everything that Dirk saw in the academy was nice. It seemed like a very rich school, and the fact that it was in the capital meant it was likely one of the richest institutions in the entire empire. The three didn't stop at these apartment buildings though and walked past them toward a plot of land with many small houses on it. Each house was two stories tall, but they weren't very wide. Despite being two stories, it only seemed like enough for a few people. They walked down a road for a bit before stopping at one of the average houses. It didn't look that outstanding compared to the others, but it also wasn't shabby in the slightest. Remember where this is, because this here is your new residence. These are the nicest places in the academy besides the teacher and staff houses. You'll be living here alone for the foreseeable future. Of course, that isn't to say that nobody can visit. Come on. Riker introduced the house before walking inside. Dirk and Rita followed, and they took a tour of the place. The first floor didn't have any walls, looking like a studio apartment. There was a table and two chairs for dining, a standard kitchen, and a living space with a couch. Then there was a staircase leading up to the second floor and one leading down into some kind of basement. The three looked around before heading up. The second floor held a hallway with two doors. The main bedroom was simple. There was a bed, a bathroom, a nightstand with a clock on it, and a closet for clothes. It was rather empty with no decorations or unnecessary items, 
but Dirk found it nice. He wasn't one for fancy things anyway. As for the second bedroom, it was basically identical. Dirk would only be using his extra space though. Then, the three headed back down and went into the basement. The door leading into the basement was metal and much more secure than even the front door to the house. While it was already unlocked, Riker explained to him that it used a magic code to open and that he could set the code later. Entering the basement, Dirk was greeted with a dense mana environment. The room had nothing in it, not even a chair. Riker explained its desolation. This is a place where you can come to meditate and practice magic. And, should you get into alchemy, enchanting, or smithing, you can get tools and stations to put in here. Think of this as a magic workshop for all your magical needs. Dirk nodded. The mana in this room was nice, and while he didn't really need it right now, he was sure it could help him in the future. Forming his first mana heart required dense mana, so this room would help with that. As for whether he would pursue any of these crafting professions, he would have to think about it. Now, a few things you need to know. You'll have to take yourself to classes every day. As for food and supplies, they'll be delivered to you every five days. I've already arranged for you to be brought meats and other foods. I guess now's the time where you also need to learn how to cook. Cooking is an important skill to know. As for visitors, anybody can come or go at any time. The academy doesn't monitor your every action. However, as your father, please exercise self-control when it comes to girls. You're going to hit puberty soon and I know how tempting it can be to bring a girl back home, especially when you live alone. But until you're an adult, I don't want you getting into any relationships, at least not any serious ones. Magic comes first, understood? Yes sir. Dirk answered dully. Was he really getting the talk? Self-control wasn't an issue for him. He could keep raging hormones in check. After all, he had to do it in the super soldier program. However, since the topic was brought up, Dirk thought about it a bit more. What was a relationship like? He had never gotten involved with anyone before, and liking someone was a foreign concept to him. Even Ava was just a friend. What if he started to like someone? What did it feel like to have someone that liked you? Dirk was curious, but also apprehensive. He didn't forget that he was only twelve here. Getting into a relationship with anyone his age would be weird for him. Dirk pondered, but he didn't let it show on his poker face. Seeing him respond so bluntly, Riker smiled. Anyway, that's the housing situation. Here's the keys. Keep them in a safe place, and don't give them to anyone. You're actually only getting this house because your mother said you could handle the responsibility. Usually I would have you put into a dorm with one or two others. Oh. That reminds me. I have a certain rule that all your siblings abide by at the academy. Remembering something, Riker spoke seriously. Dirk straightened subconsciously. In the academy, there's going to be many conflicts. They can be political, verbal, or physical. This place is one of competition, so fighting is only natural. However, there are a few people who will wield the statuses of their parents or teachers to oppress others. None of my children are going to be one of those people. So, I don't care what happens, you will not use my name or the Strider family name as you please. You will solve your own conflicts by your own power. The only time when you can use my name is when you are in mortal danger, but even then my name won't necessarily be a valid option to use. Do you understand this rule? Yes, sir. Good. Now, this rule also comes with its perks. Because your father has a high status as a Marquis, you don't need to worry about bowing down to those very kids who attempt to wield their status. Again, you solve conflicts by your own power and there's nothing that can stop you from fairly beating someone. Basically, I'm solving all the political conflicts automatically. You only need to worry about the physical and verbal ones. Alright, enough of that. Let me take you on a tour through the school. Tomorrow there's an entrance ceremony, and you'll also need to know where your classes are. Saying that, Riker spun around and left the house. Dirk and Rita followed and they went on to explore all the various facilities throughout the school. 
First, Riker took him to all of his classes. This year, Dirk was enrolled in five classes. The first was general education where they taught him things like history, advanced mathematics, world studies, and more. The second was his body refining class where they were taught combat arts and trained to increase their stamina and endurance. After that, there was one class for each of Dirk's dark, earth, and fire elements. He would be learning spells and rune theory in those classes. They would also serve as time to accumulate mana and train one's technique. These classes took up a lot of his day. From 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. he would be in classes, totaling nine hours of class time and one for a lunch break. This was a pretty long time to be in class, but Dirk didn't really mind. He wanted to learn the things they were teaching. Plus, this still left him with enough time to work out before and after class. As for training his mana technique, he could do that throughout the day and just before he went to sleep. After some thinking, Dirk was able to revise his daily schedule and pleasantly found that he could maintain the things he'd been doing. And since he had already finished destroying the skin of his hands and feet, he didn't need to worry about being partially disabled. He could continue doing destruction cycles and simply deal with the pain it would cause. That reminds me, I gotta move on to my legs and finish off my upper body. After that though, I'll need to do my head and face. That's not going to be fun, but oh well. Dirk shook his head at the inevitable scene he would cause. He couldn't get out of destroying anything, and the last things he needed to do were the lower body and the skin from his neck up. For the lower body, he would have to deal with the skin on his but being destroyed for a while. That would hurt when sitting, but at least it was hidden. But his face? He would go bald and look like a hideous monster for a few weeks. He couldn't avoid it though. All he could do was either get a mask or only do one half of his face at a time. After Riker took Dirk to his classes, he moved on to some other facilities. The first place was an arena, and it was a colosseum like building that students could battle in. Apparently, the school held tournaments every six months for student rankings. Each class would fight amongst themselves, forming something of a hierarchy. It was the most participated in event in the school, and there was no lack of students wishing to test their skills and rise on the leaderboard. After they toured the Colosseum, they went on to the Magic Pyramid. In this pyramid, students could go and look at all kinds of different spell books, practice runes, practice spells, or simply meditate in peace. The place was a literal pyramid where the higher you went, the higher the mana density. Just the bottom layer held mana as dense as the one in Dirk's magic workshop at his house. While he couldn't go higher, both Riker and Rita assured him that it was many times denser up there. Riker had even been to the top, and he said it felt like swimming in a pool of liquid mana. In the pyramid were also some rooms and open firing ranges. These rooms and ranges could be used to test one's spells and techniques on test dummies. Then there was the library with many magical books, and meditation rooms where one could get absolute peace and quiet. Riker said that people often used those rooms to advance in tears since they couldn't be distracted. You could also hold a single room for up to two months at a time. Lastly, Riker brought Dirk to the Halls of Artisans. This place was the center of all magical production in the academy. All enchanting, forging, and alchemy took place here, and as soon as they entered, Dirk was hit with a wave of magical elements and boisterous yelling. Hey! I need two iron ingots and a bucket for oil. And when I find who took my bucket, I'm gonna roast their ass in my furnace. Where are my herbs? You! Get me three spiked leaves right now. I've got 73 seconds before this pot explodes. Somebody please tell me where the damn tongs are. How about you just pull the metal out with your bare hands? You dimwit. Ah. Who the hell took my lucky pair of goggles? Dirk was stunned as he saw people shooting between dozens of different rooms. On the right side of the hall, he could feel heavy heat and see black smoke seeping between doors. On the left, he could smell dozens of different herbal scents and see white smoke seeping between doors. The contrast between the two sides of the hall was painfully obvious. Welcome to the Hall of Artisans. Everyone pursuing one of the crafts goes here to practice and produce. On one side you have the alchemists, 
and the other is the blacksmiths. In the back are the enchanters, but there are less of them since enchanting is rather difficult. The two sides coexist in a strange harmony of understanding and trade. They are divided into two different factions, but the two sides trade what they make very often. The alchemists give the blacksmiths many potions, and the blacksmiths give out many forged goods like weapons or armor or whatever else is made. This helps both of them output more and promote something of an economy. It's not easy getting into one of the factions, but it is definitely worth it. Artisans can make good money, and many artisans have the ability to simply make what they need, saving them lots of money as well. I think you should try your hand at it next year. Riker introduced the place and recommended Dirk to it. Dirk just looked around for a long while. He wondered why it was so chaotic instead of quiet and orderly. Didn't people have to concentrate while crafting? Why were people yelling for last-second things? He also could have sworn that he saw a teenager run out of a room with a boiling pot of something. Did he seriously leave his station midway? Dad. Why is everyone going crazy? Dirk asked the question on his mind. Because it helps develop concentration. One needs to be able to adapt to things on the fly, and if you get easily disturbed, you won't be able to go far in your craft. You have to be able to operate in all kinds of situations. Like that boy who left his station with his solution halfway boiled. He needed materials, and didn't have anyone to rely on, so he simply brought the pot that he couldn't take his eyes off of to the warehouse where the herbs are. Granted, he probably should have done better preparations, but then again, who knows if this is his fourth go at it. Maybe he ran out of only one herb and didn't realize it while he was focusing. But he was able to think of a quick solution, and that batch may not necessarily be a failure. Quick thinking is a precious skill. This helps hone that. Dirk stayed silent as he deliberated on whether or not he agreed with the methodology. Quick wit was indeed precious, and he guessed that this would indeed help train that. Still though, he was baffled by how chaotic it all was. Though, it also looked kind of fun. He made a mental note to check out the crafts in the future. Anyway, keep this place in mind for the future. Although you probably won't be able to do alchemy very well since you don't have the water attribute, you should be able to do forging. I'll scratch alchemy off my mental note then. Dirk shrugged helplessly. The three left the Hall of Artisans soon after talking a bit more. For the most part, Riker had given Dirk a pretty thorough tour. He wouldn't even be stepping foot into some of the places until next year. This year, he just needed to stick to his classes and build up his foundation more. That was the main purpose of the first year in the academy. Eventually, Riker took Dirk back to his residence and left. Rita though decided to take him to her place so he knew where it was. There, he ate lunch and talked with Rita about the years they hadn't seen each other. Rita had matured a lot. While she was still a pretty happy-go-lucky person, Dirk could tell by her demeanor that she had grown up quite a bit. That's what it took though to wield more power. However, when Rita started talking about her experiences with dungeon diving, Dirk got interested. You remember the dungeons you read about in school right? Rita asked as she twirled a glass of water. The glass was levitating above her hand while her dark mana coddled it. Dirk nodded to her. I do. Good. Don't forget them, because you're going to be visiting plenty. Your first year here will be teaching you all about applied magic, general essential knowledge, and how to fight. Basically, they're preparing you for the coming years. Next year is the first year where you'll finally fight and kill something. In fact, there's an initiation ceremony where everyone has to take the life of a monster with their own skills. From then on, you have the option to enter the dungeons and fight real monsters. There, you'll be able to gain combat experience, collect loot, make money, and so on. It's very popular since everyone needs to make money, and that's both the easiest and hardest way to do it. Interesting. Do you dungeon dive? Dirk asked curiously. He was definitely interested in the dungeons. Yes, I dungeon dive. I actually have a party that I dive with. We've been working together for two years now. In the team, I'm the magic caster. 
I can apply various curses to monsters and deal direct damage. I gotta say though, I honestly regret not taking your offer to work out when we were kids. I've gotten injured several times simply because I wasn't flexible or nimble enough. Or when we would need to run away, I would quickly lose stamina. That's why I've been working on that void walking magic you saw me do. It's a great way to move without consuming lots of stamina. Seriously a real lifesaver. I've gotten better though. Anyway, I'm sure you'll be dungeon diving too, and I just want you to be mentally prepared for it. Though, there's also something else I should warn you about. Rita spoke seriously. You need to think carefully about how you develop your combat ability, who you meet, and what you do with your skills. While the academy encourages us to fight in the dungeons, that's only to hone our skills. Remember that we live in an empire, and the empire wants talented people working for them, killers or otherwise. Ethan chose a life in the military, and soon enough, he's going to be on a battlefield somewhere fighting actual people. Many people in the academy choose that life because they have nothing else to do when they leave. I just need you to understand that the academy is yet another bubble like the school we went to. You'll eventually have to decide whether you want to live a life of killing monsters or people. Both are dangerous and have their struggles. But I don't want you getting sucked into one without you knowing it. All right? I understand. Dirk nodded solemnly, though inwardly he was smiling bitterly. How could he not understand that wars were fought, and nations wanted talented killers? He definitely understood far more about that reality than Rita did. Chapter 23, First Day While Dirk already understood the dark reality of war, he also started seriously contemplating Rita's words. When faced with the choice, would he go back to the life he lived? Or would he shut himself in these dungeons and hunt monsters for a living? Thinking about it, Dirk actually started having a bad feeling. In his last life, he didn't get a choice. In this life, he wondered if he would. He had always been some kind of symbol for bad luck. But he had never been able to figure out if he was the unlucky one. He didn't know if he wanted to go back to the life of fighting day after day. He could kill, and he could do it very well, but did he want to? He had fought for a leader that only saw him as a pawn to be played, a disposable dog to take care of the dirty work. The only thing special about him was that he was a strategic weapon capable of taking care of nearly any task. He was just a really strong dog. Now though, he had more of a choice. If he absolutely didn't want to, Dirk didn't need to fight anybody. Worst case, he left home, disappeared, and started a life tending to a farm or something like that. However, when he thought about living a life of mediocrity like that, he couldn't see himself doing it. He wasn't drawn to it. For once, he wanted to do something that he at least agreed with. He wanted to exercise his ability to do something, good. After all, he knew how dark humanity could be. Thinking about all the people that he was capable of helping, he couldn't shut himself away. But at the same time, he couldn't help everyone, and he wouldn't kill himself for justice. Justice was always a tricky thing in his eyes. It changed, and because of that, he couldn't define what justice was to him. Dirk had many conflicts in his head. He didn't know where he belonged. Did he belong in the dark? Did he belong on the battlefield? Did he belong in a dungeon? Should he kill people? If he did, what kind of people were good or bad? Did he have the right to judge people? Could he define good and bad? And what about his own freedom? Would he allow himself to be leashed by some rules again? The questions boggled his mind, and he became frustrated when he couldn't answer them. For once in his life, he didn't have a set direction. However, all that would have to be dealt with in the future. For now at least, he had things he needed to do, like magic classes. He could slowly figure out his purpose over time. Dirk hung out at Rita's house and ate dinner there, after which he left and went back to his own house. Unlocking the door with his fancy new keys, he entered the desolate living space. Well, he thought it would be desolate, but after flicking on a light, he could see luggage strewn throughout the room. He walked over to the dining table that had a note on it. It was from his mother, and it said that this was all his stuff from the house. 
there was also a case of healing potions for him to use. It ended by telling him to be careful. Dirk smiled after reading the note. He cast the spark spell to burn it before turning and bringing his luggage upstairs. After situating everything, he washed up before heading to bed. Beep, beep, beep. Dirk's eyes flew open when he heard an alarm. Looking at the time, he saw that it was 5 a.m. He took a deep breath before hopping out of bed. It was time to work out. Rinsing himself and putting on a pair of shorts and shoes, Dirk walked out of his house and into the cold morning air. The sun hadn't yet peeked over the horizon, so everything was still dark. Dirk didn't mind it though. He had memorized the layout of the school, and his eyes were more sensitive to light than normal as per his cybernetic enhancements. He could see fine and already knew the route he would take on his run. With a direction, Dirk ran onto the street that wound through the neighborhood. Soon, he left the neighborhood and ran past the apartments, maintaining a single, steady pace. After the apartments, he ran across the front of the school. Then, he ran around to the Colosseum, past it to the Magic Pyramid, down toward the Hall of Artisans, and then back to the neighborhood. This route was a loop that essentially circled the school, and it was a whole six miles long. Dirk did three laps before going back to the house and beginning his bodyweight exercises. By the time he was finished with that, it was 8 a.m. The entrance ceremony was at 9, so he prepared himself to go. He washed up, ate some food that had been put into a cooler before by his father, and got dressed. He left for the Colosseum 15 minutes before the start of the ceremony, and as he walked, he pondered over his workout. Things are starting to get easier and easier. I can deactivate my nanites to prevent them from giving me more energy and recovering quickly, but anima is starting to show its effects. I'm simply stronger, faster, and have more stamina. Soon enough, these workouts aren't even going to be enough to get me tired unless I go for several hours. I should see if I can find any way to fix that. Dirk had been thinking about this issue for a while now, and finally, it was starting to become a problem. He could run for several miles as a warm-up, and he was forcing himself to go faster and faster just to get himself tired. Plus, the fact that he didn't have weights meant that he had nothing to push his muscles to the limit with. Dirk was approaching the stamina of his past life. While his strength wasn't there yet, it wasn't far. He would easily reach it in a couple more years just by growing. Anima was just that miraculous. He hoped though that the academy would have a solution to his problem. There was no way that someone in this world before him hadn't had and dealt with his very problem. And since the academy was so amazing, they had to know of a way to help. Dirk would be shocked if they didn't. Well, I have a class for it, so let's just wait for that. With that, he put the thoughts to the back of his mind and looked around. Since the ceremony was about to start, there were crowds of people around him of all ages and sizes. Everyone was flooding to the Colosseum as well, and the atmosphere was exciting. After all, everyone here was accepted into the academy. For the New Bloods, they were thrilled to have been accepted by such a prestigious institution. For the veterans, they were focused on working even harder toward their goals. Everyone had something to do here and a goal to achieve. Dirk simply made his presence faint as he blended into the crowd. Since he was only twelve, he was rather small and capable of slipping through places. After a bit of maneuvering, he passed through the entrance to the Colosseum. Walking through the gates, he saw signs that designated where the students of each year sat. He quickly found the first-year sign and followed it up to the seating area where he found a random seat and sat down. It looked like there were already a few hundred students around his age there. Dirk guessed they were his classmates. Please take your seats. There are three minutes until the ceremony starts. Suddenly, on the stage of the Colosseum, a woman behind a podium spoke into a magical device that amplified her voice. Hearing it, the crowds entering and mingling around the place quickened their paces. In only a few minutes, nearly all of the empty seats had been filled. When things had fallen into place, the woman walked up to the podium again. The Colosseum quieted as everyone sensed her presence. She was a beautiful woman wearing some fancy robes that did nothing to hide her curves, and all the pubescent boys near Dirk were eyeing her like a nice slab of meat. 
Welcome everyone. I congratulate you all for being accepted into the Horizon Magic Academy. Out of the thousands upon thousands of applicants across the Empire, only you all were chosen. This is a high honor, and I hope you all do your best to make the most out of every day. For the dawn of Horizon. For the dawn of Horizon. The Colosseum reverberated the woman's pledge, creating a large echo. Dirk just watched on. You can't have a strong nation without some nationalism. He had also learned these basic pledges and salutes. The woman went on to say a short speech about how lucky all the students are and how they needed to push themselves so as to become powerful individuals worthy of respect. This went on for around ten minutes before she finally passed on the mic. Now, without further ado, let me set the stage for our headmaster. Duke of the Empire and Tier 8 Magus, put your hands together for Headmaster Hillshire. Hmm. Hearing that name, Dirk perked up as the crowd roared with cheers. He looked down and saw Duke Hillshire step on stage. Clad in royal robes, he stood and smiled valiantly while looking through the crowd. Seeing the headmaster look upon them with fond eyes and an encouraging smile, all the new students were instantly drawn to like him, and the returning students cheered for him even more. From the almost fanatic cheers, it seemed like the entire academy idolized this man. The instant the duke put his hand up, the entire crowd quieted. Dirk was instantly baffled. Who could command this kind of respect and reverence? It was like the duke was actually the king. Thank you all for your warm welcome. You may simply call me headmaster. Like the lady before me, I congratulate you all on successfully entering the academy. Here at the academy, you all will struggle, experience hardship, and claw your way to a more powerful existence. The road is long and hard, but I assure you that I will do everything in my power to open up the largest road for you all. While we may compete and fight here in the academy, at the end of the day, we are all brothers and sisters brought together through the pursuit of a higher purpose. You will be seeing a lot of me throughout your days here, and that's because I'm here to help each and every one of you. I don't ask that you treat me as the headmaster, but as a teacher here to guide you. If strength is what you desire, and you wish to be men and women who bring good into the world, then I will show you that path. Simply follow me, and together we will forge a path to greatness. The Duke spoke with deep and bold words full of spirit. The kids throughout the stadium were mesmerized, and nobody made a peep. When he finished, the place was quiet for several seconds before cheering erupted even louder than before. Dirk sat there silently though. This man really is one for the people. No wonder they love him so much. Though, if anyone were to be a good headmaster, it would be him. He loves raising children. Dirk thought back to the two times he visited the Duke. The first time, he had gotten a good idea of how much the Duke loved kids. Later, his father told him that the Duke had been trying to have children for over 80 years with his wife. In all that time, they have had 19. From that, one could easily see how kid-crazy the Duke was. When Dirk thought about it, it made sense that he was the headmaster of such a school. The man was accomplished, strong, and loved being a mentor. Who better to run the academy? Though I'm surprised father is brothers with him. I wonder how they came to get so close. At least I know why father works at the academy now. Dirk's thoughts moved about as the duke went off the stage. After him, many other staff members introduced themselves to all the students. None of them particularly cared though. It seemed like the headmaster was the only one with all the attention. The rest were bland compared to him, no matter how amazing they tried to make themselves look. After almost an hour, the speeches finally came to an end. By this time, all the students simply wanted to get on with the day. Luckily, after the beautiful lady came back on stage, she sent them off with a brilliant smile. Dirk took a deep breath as he stood up with all the other students. He walked quickly and was one of the first to exit the Colosseum, dodging the crowds that already started building up. Instead of walking home though, Dirk turned to the main building of the academy where all the classes were. Today, the schedule was modified, but they all still had class. Dirk made his way to his first class which was general education. The corridors were mostly empty as Dirk walked with steady steps. 
his feet made no more than a faint tapping sound as they stepped on the solid wood flooring. The wood under his feet was almost pitch black, contrasting with the white stone walls. When Dirk arrived at the classroom, he walked through the door that was already open. Inside, the teacher was sifting through papers on her desk. She didn't lift her head even when Dirk walked up to her desk. Teacher? What? The woman was startled and jerked backward, flicking her pen at Dirk. His body automatically bent to the side and his hand reached out and grabbed it. He settled back in his original position the next second like nothing happened. Who? You? Who are you? My name is Dirk Strider. I believe I'm one of your students. Dirk spoke simply, and the teacher's heart settled down. She took a deep breath before taking out a roster and looking through it. Sigh, I see. Sorry Dirk. I didn't see you come in. Ah, you can take a seat wherever you wish. You're the first one, so you get first pick. Thank you. Here's your pen. Oh, thanks. The teacher took the pen from Dirk's outstretched hand. As he went to go pick a seat though, she pondered curiously. How was he able to catch her pen? Those were some fast reflexes. Dirk walked up the stairs that led to higher desks. These desks looked like those of a college lecture hall. From Dirk's count, he found that at least 70 kids would be able to fit in this room. He took the desk at the highest level and sat on the edge closest to the staircase. Not long after he sat down, more kids started to pile in. They came in groups of three or four, and the classroom quickly got noisy. The teacher simply herded them to the desks, telling them that they could pick whatever seats were open. As this happened, Dirk sat with his eyes closed and trained his man alongs a bit. The process was more gentle though in an attempt to not disturb the surrounding mana too much. All right class. Settle down. My name is Ms. Adrisha, and I'll be your general ed teacher for the year. We're going to be learning about a lot of different things, but don't worry about getting thrown off. We'll be doing this in sections so it'll be easy to keep up. All right, each of you should have three books in front of you. Go ahead and open the history book and turn to the first section. We'll take a little glimpse of all the things we'll be learning about this year. All the students followed directions and listened to the teacher as she outlined all the books and what they would be focusing on. There were three books at the seat of every student as well as a bag to hold them in. The first was the history book, second was the world studies book, and third was mathematics. These were the same subjects that Dirk learned about in the children's school, but he knew they would hold different information here. After a while, the teacher was done going through the history book. Just from the introduction, Dirk could tell how much more information was in there. It was more in-depth and held more specific details unlike in the children's school where everything was vague. It also talked about the general history of the world, including other nations. Next, they opened up the World Studies book. In there, it talked about not only other nations and their cultures but also the dungeons and how they operated. This book held a lot more information that Dirk actually wanted. If he was to dungeon dive in the future, he wanted to know what the hell dungeons were. Lastly there was mathematics, but the teacher didn't touch upon that a lot. By the time they were done, there were only five minutes left in class. Everyone simply hung around and discussed stuff until the bell rang, where they all rushed out and moved to their next class with their new books in hand. Dirk hoisted his book bag and walked out as well. His next destination was the gymnasium. It only took a couple minutes to arrive. After walking in the doors, he found he wasn't the first one. A bunch of kids were hanging around the place, talking and laughing about whatever they had on their minds. However, there were surprisingly few. Only forty kids were present, and Dirk didn't see any more people trickling in. He simply walked over to one of the walls where there was a bench and sat down. In this gym, there were two other large rooms that were used as lockers and for changing. Dirk made a mental note to start bringing a change of clothes. Huh. Oh. Dirk. Suddenly, there was an excited shout. Dirk's head snapped to the noise, and he saw a cute girl with small antlers coming off her forehead. Hello, Ava. Chapter 24, 
classes slash eccentric. So we are in the same class. Now we can continue our training. Ava beamed as she took up a spot next to Dirk. She had been worried that she wouldn't see him again, but now she was content. Choosing to take the body refining course felt like the best decision she ever made. Dirk nodded to her, but he had other thoughts. Depending on what they did in this course, they may not be able to practice anything. It would have to be on their own time. Still, he was happy that she was there. It was nice to have someone familiar there with him. What was your class before this? Dirk asked as they waited. I had my magic class. For the water element. So you have the water attribute? Yes. It's my only one though. Is your affinity high at least? Yeah. It's 97%. That's good. You didn't have to tell me though if you didn't want to. That information is best kept a secret. No, it's fine. I trust you. Dirk thought about that for a second before nodding. Ava's cheeks also reddened a bit, but she didn't mind. It was the truth. Well, I have a suggestion for you. My father said that one needs the water attribute to be good in alchemy. It might be something to consider since you have it. I see. I'll take a look. But we can't do that stuff until next year, right? Correct. It would be enough to simply think about it this year. Right. Ava nodded in agreement, and they both went quiet. It wasn't long after though that they heard a shout. Everyone gather up. Around me. The kids all heard this booming voice and turned. In the middle of the gym stood a large burly man. His face was tough, his beard looking like a five o'clock shadow, his head bald, and his muscles bulged from under his shirt. He looked like a really intense fitness trainer. Getting a glimpse of his imposing figure, the kids quickly gathered in front of him, including Dirk and Ava. He looked at everyone before speaking. My name is Instructor. That's all you will call me. I will obviously be your instructor for the year. I'm in charge of doing three things. Pushing you to your physical limits with exercise, teaching you combat arts, and teaching you how to utilize anima. As body refiners and warriors, we must learn how to use our body to its fullest ability so as to ensure our survival and our enemy's demise. I know all of you can use magic, but being able to use your physical body and anima is yet another insurance for your life. I myself have killed plenty of mages in the military only because they were incapable of escaping my grasp. The instructor raised his hand and clenched his fist as if he were crushing a heart, making the kids in front of him shiver. They all felt a bit more wary of this instructor who had killed before and subconsciously moved to be a little farther away from him. Becoming strong warriors will allow you to utilize more techniques and it can even supplement your magical ability. No matter what, it is not a bad thing to be learning this, only good. When the time comes that you're in a battle for your life, you will think back and thank yourselves for not neglecting your physical ability. So let's get started. I'm going to teach you the drills we will do every day. Don't forget them. Now line up. The kids all looked around them after the instructor shouted. At the halfway point in the gym there was a line. They all ran to it and lined up beside each other. Though, not all kids were quick-witted and couldn't seem to think as they just walked and glanced around. Hey! You! Move your scrawny ass over to the line. What about that don't you understand? The instructor yelled at several kids who trembled before running as fast as they could to the line. After a minute or so, everyone was standing side by side on the line. Finally. You all better learn this stuff quickly. Now, I will demonstrate a workout, and then all of you will do it. Keep your eyes peeled. The instructor shouted before dropping to the floor and performing an exercise. All the kids watched and none of them made a peep. Dirk and Ava were standing next to each other, and when they saw the instructor do the exercise, they glanced at each other. They already knew this one. It was likely that they already knew all of them actually. There were only so many ways to move the body after all. And sure enough, by the time the instructor had finished the last one, Ava was smiling. She and Dirk already knew all of them. 
she suddenly felt that this class wouldn't be difficult at all. Could they really be more difficult than Dirk's hellish workouts? Unlikely. After the instructor performed the exercises, he led the class to do an actual workout. One moment all the kids were doing suicide sprints, and the next they were doing push-ups with shaky arms. Some kids even ran over to a trash bin and threw up, falling to the floor as if they died. Meanwhile, Dirk and Ava did the workouts with ease. The entire session counted as more of a warm-up for them, and they were the first to finish everything. Even the instructor noticed how fit they were. Impressive. Hey everybody. Take a good look at these two. They're doing everything easily. This is a walk in the park for them. By the end of the year, all of you will be just like them. In fact, until you can catch up to them, all of you will be doing suicides every day. Now move. And don't vomit on the nice floor. The instructor yelled at all the kids who were slacking off or giving up. These kids hadn't yet been forced to do things that pushed them to their limits. Besides a few of the poorer ones, their lives up until now were, were relaxed and simple. Nobody was like Dirk or Ava and had already been training for a few years. The class was concluded after an hour. Before they left, the instructor told everyone to prepare clothes specific for this class starting tomorrow. He said that they would also be using the lockers inside the rooms to change and wash up a bit before leaving for classes. Until then though, they would just have to go to class nice and sweaty in their nice clothes. With a smile, the instructor waved off the dying kids after the bell rang. Dirk and Ava left the gym with light steps. So, since we won't be training hard for a while in that class, should we do our own training? Ava spoke as they walked out. Dirk thought about it. Yeah, we should. When do your classes start and end? I have three classes. The first starts at 9 a.m., and the last ends at 2 p.m. Only three? Yeah. How many do you have? Five. I'm in class from 9 to 7. Huh. That's a lot. Well, we could do things before and after I guess. After was surprised before thinking of something that would work for them. Dirk nodded at her suggestion. That works. Do you have a dorm? Yes. I see. Here's what we'll do. Meet me in front of the Hall of Artisans ten minutes after seven. I'll take you from there to my house where we'll do our workouts. House? Wait, you're in those houses? Yes. Dirk nodded as Ava's eyebrows rose. After thinking for a second though, she could only sigh. I guess you are a high noble. All right then. Good. Then I need to get to my next class. Okay. See you later. Ava waved, and they went their separate ways. Magic is the process by which our souls communicate with mana and affect the physical world. Over thousands of years, our predecessors have discovered and analyzed how our souls communicate with mana, and through this they have discovered runes. Runes are a magical language rooted in the nature of magic, not just some weird lines that we draw with the elements. Through runes we can communicate with mana and control it in a more reliable, codified way. This allows us to develop advanced spells. A teacher lectured his students not long after they sat down. All the kids couldn't help but be drawn to his voice as he spoke of ethereal concepts and drew mystical diagrams on the board. Dirk was one of the ones listening intently. He had always wondered about the workings of magic, and this was the first time he was going to get real lessons on it. In this class, I'll be teaching you all earth magic. To learn this you'll need to know about earth and runes and mana. Each of the elements has different runes and different theories behind them, so knowledge doesn't transfer over much from one element to the other. However, only those with more than one attribute need to worry about this. Most of you in this class only have the earth attribute anyway. But for those with more than one, you'll find that after understanding one, you'll achieve a more general understanding of how to learn another, not unlike learning languages. Now, all of you will be starting off with learning the chore magic and a couple other basic spells. We'll break each down and talk about each individual rune until all of you can fluidly cast the spells. This is a gradual process that can vary in results depending on your affinity, 
but none of you have affinities so low that there's any worry about not being able to cast these simple spells. Go ahead and open the books in front of you to the first section. The teacher laid things out clearly, and the students followed directions. After opening the books, they got rough ideas of what they would be learning, and the teacher even started some of the first lesson during the second half of class. Ding, ding, ding. Before long, the bell rang, and everyone closed up. For most of the kids in the class, this was their last class of the day since they only had one attribute. However, Dirk still had two more classes, so he packed up the book and headed out. The next class was his fire class, and here the teacher did mostly the same thing as the previous one. He talked about some basic principles before getting more specific, and it ended with everyone having a general overview of what they would learn. This led to Dirk heading to his final class that taught the dark element. However, when class started, he was surprised. There's only 15 people here. Dirk counted the small number of kids. The earth class was filled entirely, holding 70 kids. The fire class had held 45, which was a bit lower but not by much. But for this class to only have 15 was odd. His questions were answered though when the teacher walked in. The teacher was a very slender man who wore flamboyant, colorful clothes and held the happiest smile one had ever seen. At first glance, Dirk had thought he was some kind of circus performer with those clothes. He had expected something dark, since this was the teacher for the dark element, but this had stumped him. Hello kids. How are you all today? You, how was your day so far? Instead of doing an introduction, the teacher walked up to a boy and asked his question. The kid was stunned for a bit. What kind of teacher was this? Um, fine? Fine? It's not fantastic? Exhilarating? Are there any girls who have caught your eye so far? Wah. And no. No? Well how could that be so? There are many pretty girls here. Oh, I remember when I was your age at this school. There were so many beauties that I couldn't choose between them all. In the end, I was caught dating four of them. You, my strapping young friend, must go out in the world and get yourself a woman. There is no room for cowards in the world of romance. How about you, young lady? What kind of meals have you eaten today? Suddenly changing subject, the teacher moved to another student, his exciting clothes moving with his body as he shifted. The girl had originally been giggling at the boy in the spotlight, but now she was nervous. She thought back to the lunch she had a few hours prior. I, I had some meat soup. Meat soup? Ah, such a wonderful food, isn't it? A mixture of the greasy meat and sweet broth. Food is a brilliant thing all races around the world seek to perfect. The excitement it brings to all our tongues is indescribable. Right. I forgot to mention my name. As if he remembered who he was, the teacher suddenly backed away from the girl and stood in the front of the class. He took up a more formal posture, but with his crazy clothes it only looked weird. My name is Gerald Vincent. I'm a tier 6 dark mage. This year, I'll be at your service. Now where's my list? Gerald spun around in place like a dog chasing his tail before reaching into his shirt and pulling out a crumpled piece of paper. He read it before his eyes lit up. Aha. Okay, so I'll be teaching you the fundamentals of dark magic. Now, the first thing you need to know about dark mana in general is that it is inherently, crazy. It's insane, bombastic, and literally out of this world. It is very unlike light magic which seeks to control everything. Gosh, I really do hate those with light magic. I mean, what's the point of life if you can't live it the way you want? Gerald shouted with surprising hostility, surprising all the students. Dirk also tensed up and reached for his waist, feeling a bit less secure when he didn't feel a weapon. This was an instinctive reaction when he didn't feel safe. The next moment though, Gerald returned to his brilliant happiness. Anyway, dark magic is best controlled by those who don't control it. One needs to flow with dark magic, loosening restraints and ridding thoughts of manipulating it. You must invite the darkness in, channeling it to do the things you desire. As he spoke, 
Geralt spun around in a dance and traced black lines with his fingers. What resulted was a rather elegant display of control, except it wasn't control. It was like he was merely following the will of the dark element, but at the same time, the dark element was following his will. The two synchronized to produce a giant black rune in midair. Dirk could feel copious amounts of the dark element radiating off of the rune. This symbol I drew in the air is one that seeks to contaminate and obliterate the light element. It would instantly kill anyone below tier 5. However, since I forgot to add a circle, it will explode in about 2 second dash dot. Boom! Before he could finish, the symbol suddenly erupted out with dark mana, filling the classroom. Dirk's soul was shaken a bit as the mana slammed into him. However, he suddenly had an idea and decided to use his mana lungs to breathe in the next moment. The super dense mana flooded into him, and the bottleneck to tier 2 that he had been struggling to get past for a year suddenly broke down. When that barrier broke down, Dirk felt as if his soul had opened the floodgates. Mana from the atmosphere flooded into him for a moment before calming, filling him with rejuvenation. Dirk's ability to sense mana sharpened at that moment. Looking back, it felt as if he had been congested all this time, and his soul was finally able to take a deep breath. This, feels nice. Dirk reveled in the feeling for a while as all the dark man around the classroom dissipated. When everyone had settled back down, they all looked at Geralt, who was actually smiling at Dirk. Congratulations, my talented friend. You've broken past the first tier to officially enter the world of mages. Tell me, how are you feeling right now? Geralt rapidly approached Dirk, who backed into his seat with obvious caution. The previous feeling of comfort quickly disappeared. I feel nice. Nice. Yes, it's an adequate description. For the first time, your soul is going beyond what an ordinary person can accumulate. Your sense for mana has become sharper, your ability to channel it strengthened. Now, you'll follow your technique to cultivate some kind of core that will be the foundation for the rest of your magical career. You could say that you've taken a step through the gate and can finally ascend the stairs to godhood. Geralt raised his hand to the sky as if he were trying to grasp heaven itself. Dirk though only felt that the man was dangerously volatile. He didn't know how to handle such a person. However, his description was spot on. Dirk was now at the level where he could create his first man heart. He was actually a bit glad that Geralt had done what he did. Geralt looked back at him after a second of suspense. I'm excited for you, young man. What's your name? Dirk. Dirk. I will remember that name. A child who could grasp the opportunity one gave him will surely go far. In fact, I am now going to declare you my favorite student. Now. Allow me to read you all my list which tells us what we will be learning this year. Saying that. Geralt walked back down to the front and read off his crumpled paper. Dirk was stunned though. Opportunity? Geralt had done that for him? Did he see that he was on the verge of advancing? Dirk couldn't seem to get a read on that man at all. However, Dirk's face fell when he heard that he would be the favorite student. Even the other kids glanced over in pity. Who wanted to be the target of that man's attention all the time? They would all rather be the target of his ire. The rest of that class went a bit more smoothly once the students were able to handle the bundle of chaos that was their teacher. The list he read had four bullet points on it, each pointing out a general concept like runes or mana control or spells. Apparently, this was the curriculum for the year. There weren't even any books. Finally, after a long two hours, the class ended. Each of the students left the room with confused minds. The teacher was eccentric and volatile, but he was nice. They couldn't seem to make up their minds about him and left with unsure steps. Chapter 25 Key After leaving class, Dirk walked straight to the front of the Hall of Artisans. He could see lots of activity inside and outside. This place didn't calm down at all. However, there was one person that stood still amongst the bustling crowds. Dirk sighed as he approached Ava, happy to get the insane teacher off his mind. Dirk! Follow me. Dirk motioned her over, and Ava took up a position on his right. 
the two left the crowds and headed towards the dorms, walking past to the nicer residences. Ava made sure to memorize the route she took. Luckily, each house had a number and every street a name, so when they finally arrived at Dirk's house she could remember the address. Soon, they arrived. Ava excitedly followed Dirk as he led her into his home. This is a nice place. Much better than our dorms. Plus you get to live alone. Ava complimented as they walked inside. While the place was kind of bare, it was still a house and plenty for a single occupant. Honestly, she was surprised that Dirk was even capable of living on his own. I'll go get changed. Dirk went straight upstairs, leaving Ava to her devices. She sat down on the couch, and a few minutes later, Dirk came walking down. Backyard. With a word, both of them went to the kitchen and exited to the back of the house. Each house had a backyard, except there were no boundaries between each yard. It was just one big strip of grass that connected each house next to and across from each other. Only 80 meters away he could see the backyard of the house across from his. Let's do some martial arts. Tonight I'm going to do another destruction cycle, so I might not be so effective tomorrow. All right. Where at? My calves. I also might do my hamstrings. I see. If you do, it'll hurt to sit down in classes. It'll be bearable. Now square up. We'll do some grappling first. Saying that, the two approached each other. Ava had taken off her shoes, and her clothes were light but tighter fitting. Dirk was only in shorts. He never really wore a shirt when working out, and Ava had gotten used to handling his bare body. The two quickly started their spar. They tousled with each other and allowed the other to get in plenty of throws or locks. Sparring how they did was surprisingly exhausting, and within half an hour, both were sweating. Thankfully, the cold evening breeze was there to cool them off. Thud. Ow. After Dirk did a throw, Ava landed with a pound. However, she seemed to have gotten hurt, and Dirk stopped the lock he was about to put her in. What happened? Nothing, just my antlers. They've been getting longer. Ava rubbed her head as she sat up, and Dirk nodded understandingly. He hadn't forgotten that she was a deer hybrid, and with her getting older, her antlers were getting longer by the day. They were already several inches long and were beginning to branch off. Hmm, if you have long antlers, your ability to grapple will be greatly hindered. Tactical maneuvering will also be difficult. I know. I've been thinking about it more and more. Are those antlers significant in any way? Dirk asked, but Ava froze up a bit. It was a purely curious question, but Ava already knew what he was alluding to, and that was a sensitive topic for her. Technically, no. We deer hybrids don't rely on our antlers for any functions in magic or the like. However, Dad said that our race highly values them as something like crowns. Our antlers grow to become extremely strong, and losing them is a massive shame for a deer. Only criminals get stripped of theirs, and those who lose them in battle are considered weak. So your antlers hold cultural significance. Yes. Hmm. Dirk pondered, as did Ava. He spoke after a few seconds. All right. If that's the case, what you do with them is up to you. However, it looks like they'll only become more of a problem. We may have to stop grappling in the future. Unless you cut them of course. I don't think you have any nerves in that bone, so it wouldn't hurt to cut it. Why ya? Ava stuttered a bit as he spoke about something so controversial so easily. She knew he didn't mean anything bad by it though. If there was one thing she came to understand about Dirk, it was that he was straightforward. This was a purely honest suggestion to make combat easier, and she couldn't disagree with his logic. Well, let's just do some striking. Dirk brushed off the topic, as did Ava. She could think about his suggestion later. The two did training for a few hours, after which Dirk made them food, albeit not good food. Since he wasn't adept at cooking, the meat he cooked came out rather leathery. Luckily, the bread was at least good and melting cheese on it was easy. After the two powered through the tough meat, they enjoyed the bread. 
After that, Ava left in the dark of night after making plans to do some training in the morning. Dirk offered to escort her home, but she said she could just jog. The dorms weren't far away and it would only take a couple minutes to get there. With that, they bid each other good nights. The next morning, Dirk woke up at the crack of dawn. After doing his morning routine, he went outside and felt the cold morning air. Around this time of year was fall, so it was chillier than normal. He went on to do some martial movements outside, a form of meditation he was taught. It consisted of fast and slow movements, powerful and light strikes. Each movement transitioned into the other, and by the end he would come full circle, repeating the process as many times as he wished. Not long after he started, Ava arrived. After knocking and getting no response though, she went around the back and found him doing his movements. She didn't say anything as she walked over and stood next to him, doing the same exact thing. The two moved in almost perfect sync. Dirk had also taught Ava these movements, and they both had done them thousands of times. Ava had come to greatly enjoy doing these movements. They stabilized her body, calmed her emotions, relieved stress, and combined with the cold air that she had gotten so familiar with, pleased her to no end. It had become her favorite ritual to do with Dirk. The two did five cycles before coming to a stop. After completion, they opened their eyes at the same time and looked at each other. After making eye contact with Dirk, Ava broke out in a brilliant smile, almost laughing with delight. Dirk tilted his head as he unconsciously smiled a bit as well. You seem to be in a good mood. Sorry, I'm just happy. I can't control my smile. Ha ha ha. Ava started laughing the next moment. She just found it hilarious that she couldn't control her happiness. It seemed like she was overflowing with it. Dirk also chuckled a bit seeing her look so giddy. That smile truly was contagious. Not long after, he found himself laughing as well. It was like the tiniest thought was the most hilarious thing ever. This stunned Ava though. As soon as he started laughing, hers died down, and she looked at him with wide eyes. After several seconds, he claimed down as well. You laughed. Hmm. Dirk turned to Ava, who seemed like she was looking at some kind of exotic creature. You actually laughed. I've never seen you laugh before. I have no idea what you're talking about. Wah. No. You can't deny it. Hey go ahead and laugh again. I can tell a joke. A horse walks into a tavern dash. No jokes. It's training time. Ack. Before Ava could finish, Dirk suddenly grabbed her hand and twisted it, putting it into a lock. With just this, he turned her whole body and planted her on the floor. Ow. All right, all right. You win. Win what? Get up and let's do some striking practice. It's good for waking up the body. Ack, fine. Since when were you able to do that? Ava grunted as she stood up, rubbing her wrist. Dirk shrugged. Since always. Always? I've never seen you do it before. Because you're not at that level. Then teach me so I can beat you. I don't know if beating me is possible. At least, not with similar strengths. Dirk spoke arrogantly but truthfully. He was forced to be the best at all forms of combat and was trained in every way to kill a person. If it were a fight on similar grounds, Dirk was confident in being able to kill anybody else first. Not even people who were faster, stronger, or bigger would deter him. His combat sense was simply beyond the norm. After shaking out her wrist, Ava went over to start some striking practice. The two landed blow after blow on each other, but this time, Dirk went quite a bit harder on her. There were two reasons for this. One, Ava no longer had to worry about her parents, so there was no need to hide bruises. Two, she was steadily rising in combat ability, so Dirk wanted to teach her more. Meanwhile, Ava was still a bit surprised at how Dirk had so easily disabled her. The process was fast, efficient, and caught her off guard. She had been vigilant since she made the daring decision to tease him but even then she couldn't predict or react to stop anything. It seemed so effortless on his part too. 
with that one move, he had disabled her, and she got a glimpse of his true ability. It was a bit scary knowing he could easily take her out without her having the ability to resist. But when she felt his heart hits, her determination rose. She was thinking the same thing as him, and that was how she was ready for the next level. Thus was their morning training. After two hours, the two stopped and went inside to eat. Ava's body now had several bumps and purple blotches in it, but she didn't mind it. She could handle this much, though that didn't mean it wasn't very uncomfortable. Dirk had actually offered her some of his healing potion, but she turned it down. He needed them for his brutal anima training. Her injuries were nothing compared to that. After another hour, the two were walking off to their classes for the day. The night before, Dirk had indeed done a destruction cycle on both his calves. The skin was all cracked and raw, looking exceptionally painful as if someone had continuously carved it up with knives. However, Dirk didn't really care about it, and he went to classes as he normally would. Naturally, as Dirk walked down hallways, many eyes were drawn to his destroyed skin. People's eyes went wide and many gasps were heard as they gazed upon those hideous wounds. None of them could imagine what could have caused something like that. Dirk noticed the reactions of the people around him, but he didn't mind and entered his classroom. There wouldn't be much more of him destroying his skin, and he estimated he could reach Tier 3 in three months. His general education class went by uneventfully. The first book they would be going through was history, and they were only just getting started. After that came the anima class where all the students were yet again driven into the ground under brutal training. The only exceptions to this were Dirk and Ava who did everything with ease. After that were the magic classes. Earth and fire were normal for Dirk. The teachers began introducing them to very simple magics and they were now in the process of learning the runes. This was how a normal class would go. But when Dirk entered his dark element class, all that normality was thrown out the window. Good afternoon, my wonderful class. I'm so happy that all of you are here today. Isn't living to see yet another day the most beautiful thing in the world? The cool breezes, the bright sun, the green grass. Hey you! What was your favorite thing that happened today? Like last time, Geralt entered class with the sunniest disposition and pointed someone out, asking a question. Having seen it before, the student was able to respond better. Uh. I guess I had some fun in my dorm this morning. That's great. Friends truly are some of the most precious things to us. I had a friend once who lost his life to a tier 8. He burned his very soul to severely injure that godlike figure. It was such a glorious battle. At that moment, I couldn't have felt happier for him. Garrel spoke with heartfelt emotion, and the rest of class couldn't help but feel both happy and sad. Glory was something they all longed for and to hear that someone was able to go out in a blaze of glory was worthy of respect. However, Dirk felt something was off. Just as this feeling surfaced, a student asked the question. Teacher, what tier 8 was it? Ah, I believe it was a tier 8 from the hybrid empire, Unity. The battle occurred within the empire, right outside the man's house. This friend of mine was attempting to woo a woman, but who would have thought that she was married to that tier 8? That tier 8 couldn't accept my friend entering her bedroom to give her flowers, so he decided to kill him. Ah, such an injustice. Why can't a man pursue love without someone always getting in the way? Hearing this, all the students suddenly felt a lot less sorry, and their sense of respect for this friend plummeted down to nothing. Was your friend a pervert? Who goes after another man's wife? And into their bedroom no less. Dirk wanted to facepalm as he confirmed his suspicions. Nothing about this man was normal, not even his friends. A glorious battle? It was just a man taking care of a perverted intruder. He couldn't even be sure if the other details of the story were correct, like if the man really was a tier 8, or if this friend could actually injure a tier 8. Anyway, this is not the time for mourning a long-lost hero. I will teach you all how to advance your ability to wield the dark element so that you can pursue the loves you all wish. Nobody will stand in the way of my students' happiness. With one last proclamation, Gerald began the lesson. Meanwhile, 
Dirk was wondering if he wanted to learn about the dark element anymore. Would he go crazy like Garol if he did? Wary as he was though, Dirk couldn't deny that this teacher of his was kind of brilliant. When he actually taught, Dirk was able to thoroughly understand many concepts, and runes that he previously couldn't grasp were made clear. It was like this man's words had the power to directly impart wisdom. As he learned more though, Dirk started to understand how complex the dark element was. It was like the dark element was an element of confusion, disarray, and well, darkness. It was hard to understand the workings of the element and actually control it. Everything was hidden by a veil, and it prevented Dirk from actually creating a rune. All he could do was wave it around like Geralt did. Because of that, he immediately knew that learning this element would be much different and more difficult than learning his earth and fire elements. After that class ended, Dirk went home. On the way, he actually ran into Ava who was heading over at the same time. The two walked together, and after they arrived and Dirk changed, they went on to do a workout. After three hours, the two stopped and gasped for breath on the floor. The night was cool and the grass below them was soft. Dirk looked up in the sky and saw many stars and the two moons, one dark gray and one white. No matter how many times he looked at them, he couldn't get used to it. He would still raise his head expecting to only see one like on Earth. Hey! Dirk! Ha! Huh. I heard some students talking about the bi-yearly tournaments. There are still six months to go, but everyone is eager to fight. What do you think about it? I'm not sure. Dirk pondered as Ava turned her head towards him. The only reason I would want to compete is to test my magical abilities. I don't know though how quickly I can develop them. I can still only do chore magic. Well, obviously. We've only been at the academy for two days. Hmm. What tier are you at? Still tier I plus. I'm close to breaking through though. I see. I have a suggestion. Yesterday, I was still struggling with my bottleneck, but when my teacher released some dense mana, I was able to intake it and break through. Dense mana will probably help you too. Wait, really? So you're tier 2 now? Yes. Nice. Congratulations. Advancing to tier 2 isn't much to get excited about. Anyway, in my house, there's a basement room that is meant to be a magic workshop. It has dense mana, so it could help you. Oh wow. But, are you sure it's okay to let me use it? Ava asked cautiously. While she and Dirk were good friends and were casual with each other, there was still a difference in their statuses. In the world of nobles, Dirk had the backing and status of a prince. While her father was an earl, only one level below Dirk's parents, that single level was massive. This was because in the Horizon Empire, these noble titles were earned through prestige and absolute power. In fact, her father had told her some scary things about Dirk's own father, things that resulted in the title he has today. It was this difference that, despite Dirk utterly ignoring it, still carried some weight in Ava's mind. This was especially so when he tried to do things for her that came from his power as the son of a high noble. He had the house because of this power, and he wanted to let her benefit from it. This was a prime example. Hearing Ava's question though, a lot less conflict ran through Dirk's mind as he answered simply. Of course it's okay for you to use it. It's just sitting in a room. However, Dirk suddenly went quiet as he thought about when she would use it. In the mornings they trained, and it was the same at night. Her only free time was the time after she got out of class. But Dirk was still in class during that time. If he wanted her to go by the most efficient schedule, he would have to let her in while he was away. This brought him to a dilemma. How much did he trust Ava? Did he trust her enough to have unrestricted access to the house he was given by his parents? There were valuable potions that he used for healing just sitting in his room. He couldn't allow anything bad to happen to the stuff he was entrusted to. Both the house and the potions were the investments his parents put into him. Dirk stayed quiet for a while, confusing Ava. Since he was thinking about something, she just let him be. After a while, he spoke to invite her inside to eat, not completing his original train of thought. He didn't talk as he cooked both their meals. 
this time's cooking was a bit better than last time's, at least. Finally, when dinner was done and Ava prepared to leave, Dirk stopped her. He walked up to his room and rummaged around a bit before pulling out the only spare key. When he walked down and put the key in Ava's hand, her heart started thumping out of her chest. W8 Dash. When you get out of class, you can come to the house and go down to the basement. Come with me. Without letting her retort, Dirk walked down the stairs and to the basement door. Ava followed and watched as he entered the code right in front of her eyes. The code is Black Cat. Just write it in with your mana and it'll open. Ava was quiet as he opened and relocked the door to prove that the password was correct. Her mind, though, was anything but quiet. Chapter 26, Mini Heart Ava was conflicted as Dirk gave her full access to the house. She was also emotional. She now knew why he was quiet for the hour that they ate dinner. He was deliberating on whether he should give her the key. While one could say that the fact he was deliberating showed his lack of trust, she didn't see it that way. She instead realized that he was being open with her, that he was giving her a chance. They were friends, but even good friends may not trust each other with sensitive things. Giving someone access to your home was a big deal. Allowing them to use it while you were away was an even bigger deal. And considering that these houses were not easily owned in the academy, doing this was unheard of. Ava was almost overwhelmed by how much Dirk was entrusting to her. And it was all so she could train her mana. She wanted to reject it, but at the same time, she wanted to prove herself. Rejecting might also mean distancing herself from Dirk. She didn't want that. The two walked back up to the living area, and Dirk saw Ava to the door. Before she left though, she turned and wrapped Dirk up in a big hug. It was brief but deep, and afterward she saw herself off. Dirk closed the door before cleaning the place and going down to the basement himself. He pushed all other thoughts out as he sat down in the middle of the metal room. Since yesterday, he had been wondering how to go about creating his first man heart. He had his AI pull up the book, and he read through the second section. After becoming tier 2, one needs to accumulate and develop their mini heart. This mini heart is an agglomeration of an element, and upon creating it, the heart will act as a source of the element it's made out of. However, one needs to note that, until a heart is made for every attribute, the power to use an attribute will be lopsided. Because of this, it may be important for one to plan the order in which they plan to accumulate an attribute. Once this is settled, one can move on to accumulating the heart. The heart will be placed on top of your physical heart. Once the heart takes on form, the mana will saturate the heart and begin to travel outward through the blood and veins. Blood is a carrier for all types of energy, and the heart is the mechanism that drives energy transfer and, by extension, life itself. The process of mana being infused into the blood will happen naturally, and this forms the system by which mana flows through you. This mana blood system allows absolute control over the mana inside your body and also allows the uninhibited intake of mana from the outside. The mana blood will, by extension, augment the mana lungs, enhancing its effects. Dirk read through the section, and the more he read, the more excited he got. Basically, he would create a core of mana on top of his heart. This core would be made of a single element. Once the core was completed, it would push him to tier 3. However, Dirk had to be careful about his choice. If he decided to make an earth element heart, he would have lots of earth mana at his disposal and enhanced control over it, but the same wouldn't be true for his other two attributes. The other two would lag behind until he could create hearts for them. So for however long it took to create the other hearts, he would basically be relying on one single attribute. So he had to choose the most optimal one, but he didn't know which one that was. He hadn't learned many spells and developed his magical ability. However, he was able to quickly get ideas. Earth magic manipulates solids. I've seen spells in the books that can make walls of rock or launch spikes. But it's more defensive in general. Fire, though, is very much offensive. High heat, high damage. As for dark, I'm having trouble with it. I may be able to make a heart out of it but my understanding of its spells and techniques lacks behind that of the other two. 
until I develop more, I don't think I'll be able to tackle it and effectively utilize it. So I should choose between earth or fire. Offense or defense? Dirk pondered for a long while. In the end, he chose earth. While it was indeed more defensive, he also had the metal specialization which, according to his teacher, enabled the creation of metal objects and in general stronger formations. This meant his walls and spikes would be stronger than normal. Earth was a mixture of offense and defense, and he preferred the well-roundedness. Plus, his affinities were higher than that of the fire attribute. While he couldn't feel differences in his ability to detect and control the two elements, it may affect his ability to form spells or reduce their effectiveness. Until he knew for sure, he would rather take the more reliable route. With that decision made, he decided to start. The book said he needed to condense the element in a ball on top of his heart. Do this for long enough and the mana would begin to remain there permanently, forming a core or heart. However, the condensation process was a bit special. It required him to continuously contract and expand the core, not unlike how he did when training mana lungs. The rate of contraction and expansion was according to the rate of the heartbeat. Every time it beat, he would contract, and in the time between the beats it would be expanded. The only difficult part about this was actually making the mana dense enough. The book said that he needed to make it as dense as possible, and the most optimal density must be three times denser than environmental mana. As he got stronger, the density would increase until he finally formed a proper heart. Finally, there was one final thing he needed to do upon forming the heart. The book said that when the heart took sufficient form, he was to enchant it with a single rune. This rune would be responsible for matching the beats of the mana heart to the beats of the physical heart. It would also allow mana to better inject itself into the bloodstream. Technically, the rune wasn't actually necessary. However, the book highly recommended it. Not forming the rune should only be done if the person absolutely couldn't. Naturally, Dirk planned to form it. There was no reason why he shouldn't. With that, Dirk assumed he was knowledgeable enough to start. However, he remembered that he had specialized attributes, and the introduction said something about a different kind of heart needing to be formed in that case. Interface Awaiting Orders Search the Mana Heart Book for text relating to specialized heart formation. Searching Dirk waited, and in a few seconds, results came up. Dirk took a look at the page. For those with a specialized attribute, a specialized mana heart needs to be formed. This heart will be similar in function to a basic heart, except one needs to mix the two types of mana with each other. For example, for the fire element and lightning specialization, one needs to condense an equal mixture of both fire and lightning mana in the process of heart formation. Should one only condense the basic fire element, they will become lacking in their ability to utilize the lightning element. And since a lightning heart will not be formed, this could remain permanent unless they take measures to remedy the fire heart. However, fixing a heart is extremely difficult, and the results of a fix may not improve one's situation much. Thus, it is advised to form a heart of equal mixture, even if it may be more difficult and time-consuming. Dirk read this and nodded. Applying the same logic to his earth and metal attributes, he would need to condense a 50 50 ratio of earth and metal element. This wasn't impossible at all, though controlling two different elements at the same time was indeed difficult. He had no doubt that it would prolong the formation process, but he wasn't really concerned about that. That would defeat the purpose of him choosing the earth element first anyway. He found the metal specialization essential. With that clarified, he went on to officially start. He rid himself of other thoughts and concentrated on the elements around him. He could see fragments of darkness, chunks of brown earth, gray shards of metal, hot sparks of fire, and electric sparks of lightning. All these elements flowed around him like an atmosphere of elemental energy. In the outside world, mana wasn't very dense, almost like normal air. But in this basement room that condensed mana for him, it seemed more like a liquid, albeit a thin one. This ambient mana was about twice as dense as outside. With that advantage, Dirk only needed to condense it another 50% before forming the heart. Knowing that, he grabbed both the earth and metal mana around him in equal amounts, 
pulling it in and condensing a ball of the mixture right on his heart. It took a good amount of effort. He had to control two different types of mana, condense them both in equal amounts, and then do contraction cycles. For a while, Dirk struggled to do the multitasking, but after getting used to it some, he was able to move on to the contractions. To do this, he steadied the rhythm of his heart at 60 BPM. From there, he quickly pressed the mana in on itself every second for a fraction of a second, matching the heartbeat. When he did this, he could feel some of this earthen and metallic mana seep into the blood in his heart. It was a weird feeling, but an oddly refreshing one. However, it was only a tiny bit, like a drop of ink in an ocean. It would take many, many contractions to saturate his blood. The unfortunate thing was that this process of contraction and expansion was tiring. Dirk was only able to do this for 30 minutes, after which he stopped in exhaustion. When he did, the ball of mana dissipated, leaving nothing like a core at all. It was like he didn't even train for 30 minutes. Damn. This is going to take forever. I might be able to do this training three or four times a day. But if I train mana lungs, that'll go down. I don't want to stop mana lungs since it still helps my soul improve on strength, so I'll have to equal out the types of training. I'm going to be tired all day. Dirk sighed as he thought of the tiresome days ahead. If he pushed himself to the max, he would be mentally tired all hours of the day. While he didn't really want to go through such torture, he motivated himself by thinking of how he would be able to handle mental exhaustion better afterward. Struggle now so I can struggle better tomorrow. He closed his eyes and spoke a motto to himself. This was something Gray would say a lot. He believed that since Dirk would live a life of constant struggle, he should struggle hard now so the struggle in the future could be born easier. Why fight the struggle if you had no choice but to endure it anyway? Dirk eventually came to take up this thought process. It wasn't willingly though. It took several years of breaking him down to finally accept the life of hardship. Even then though, it wasn't accepted blindly. Gray gave him purpose in the things he did and that ultimately allowed him to accept the struggle. He believed that the pain was always for something, even if he didn't know what it was. This kept him going. It kept him pushing even when he felt everything was hopeless. In times of despair, the future could be both bleak and bright. He moved forward to figure out which it would be. And he never stopped since there was always more future ahead. Dirk brooded for a while, memories of Grey popping into his mind. When his chest started to hurt though, he pulled himself back to reality. He couldn't allow himself to indulge in grief. He had twelve years to do that. Now he needed to focus on his new life. He calmed down as best he could before leaving the basement. Unfortunately, he wasn't as calm as he thought he was, and he went straight to bed without even washing up like he usually did. That night's sleep wasn't a comfortable one, a faint sense of sorrow permeating from his person. From that day forward, Dirk would train his mana throughout the entire day. While it was harder to do so outside where the ambient mana wasn't dense, that was just yet another way he pushed himself to do better. He would alternate between developing his new heart and training mana lungs before leaving school and going home to work out. Now though, whenever he came home, he would always find Ava in the magic workshop training her own mana technique. Upon seeing him return, Ava would leave the room and join him in exercise as she did in the morning. The two switched between basic exercise and martial exercise. Every time they did combat training though, Dirk got progressively harder on her. He also started teaching her new techniques. Thus established their daily routine of waking, training, learning, training, and sleeping. Both advanced steadily, and before they knew it, three months had passed. It was at this time that Dirk was sitting in the living area. He was contemplating, and Ava was cooking their dinner. Ever since he gave her the house key, she had taken to cooking their meals. While Dirk had to help her at first, after a while she got the hang of it herself. Now, she never let him get up to do anything after they finished training. Hey Ava. Yes? Do you know if they sell masks in the academy? Masks? Ava tilted her head while stirring a pot of soup. She thought about the question before shaking her head. 
I've never seen anywhere that does. Why? I've finished destroying all of my skin, except for the skin on my face. Wait, you have to destroy that too? She turned around, shocked. The other body parts were fine since they were mostly hidden and didn't inhibit many functions. But the face? That was out for everyone to see. Plus, what would happen if his eyelids or lips were destroyed too much? His lips would be in constant agony and he may not even be able to close his eyes. Plus, just thinking of the hideous look he would have to walk around the school with was humiliating. Hearing her, Dirk sighed before shrugging. Yes, but it's fine. I was thinking about doing half of my face at a time. Since there's no masks, I'll just go without one. No. That's horrible. You shouldn't have to walk around and humiliate yourself like that. This technique of yours is ridiculous. It's fine. Do you really think I care about a bit of embarrassment? No. But still. Wait, you won't come out with any scars, will you? No. I haven't gotten any so far. That's good. Ava sighed in relief. If this technique scarred him everywhere then that would truly be unbearable. He would have to go around looking like a monster. Hmm, it'll be interesting going around bald for a while. You'll be bald too? The technique destroyed the hair on my arms and legs so I assume it'll do the same for my head. While it'll regrow, I'll be without hair until it's finished. Why the hell did you ever choose this technique? Ava shouted in unfairness for Dirk while slamming the pot of soup down on the table. Dirk went over to eat, and Ava stared at him as he did so. He felt this stare and knew what she was thinking. He spoke before she could. You don't need to help me. I'll be fine. It'll only be bad for a week anyway. My recovery speed is much faster now that my animal levels have gone up. You let me know if you need anything. Sure. Saying that, both of them dug into the food. Knock knock knock. At that moment though, there was a knock at the door. Dirk frowned until he heard a voice come from outside. Dirk! Open up! Or are you asleep? Coming. Hearing Rita's voice, Dirk smiled a bit and went to open the door. When he did, he could see her standing outside with a bright smile. Hey! Miss me? That expedition was long. Most of them are like that. The dungeons are large, so, who's this? Wait, dear girl. After walking in, Rita went quiet as she saw Ava sitting at the table. Ava was confused as well since she didn't recognize Rita. Rita, this is Ava. Ava, this is Rita, my sister. Oh. Nice to meet you. Hearing the name, Ava quickly stood and walked over. Meanwhile, various thoughts ran through Rita's head. Dirk, you're only twelve. Yes? Wait, no. We trained together. Did you not hear about that? About what? I knew that you guys are friends, but I didn't think it was this crazy. We've been training together for two years. She would come over to the house and mom would train us both. We just continued at the academy. Is that right? Rita looked between them both. Dirk rolled his eyes, but Ava became a bit flushed. Before the conversation delved any further, Dirk waved. Just come in. We only made enough food for us, but you can share some of my portion. Huh? Oh, no, it's fine. I already ate. Sighing, Rita dropped the subject and entered. Ava also went back to the table where the soup was getting cool. Ever since the start of the year, Rita had basically disappeared. She had told him that she was going on a dungeon dive, which could take a while. Most of the students in the higher years did that. Now, it looked like she had come back. Just looking at her, Dirk could sense a sharp combat aura. She really wasn't that happy-go-lucky child anymore. Anyway, I came by to ask about your progress. How's training? Rita spoke as she took up a spot on the couch. Dirk's table still only had two chairs. It's good. I'm about to reach rank three, and I'm already tier two. Spells are also coming together nicely. 
I'm close to learning several combat spells. Oh really? How many circles? Only one of them is two circle. Very good. I have no doubt that you'll be prepared for next year. Rita clapped excitedly. Spells were divided in power usually based on how many circles there were. More circles meant more functions and more mana input, so this naturally meant more power. The only other way to improve power was to form better runes, but those complex, high-level runes were still beyond Dirk. So what about Anima? What techniques have you learned? I haven't learned any. None? Why not? Hearing this, Rita was surprised. Dirk shrugged. There aren't any for me to learn. The anima class we're in hasn't taught any. Well that's obvious. But what about the one that came with your technique? My technique doesn't have one. That's impossible. Nearly all decent techniques have one. Look through your book again when you get the chance. It may also come naturally when you complete a section. Keep an eye out for any weird feelings you get when you advance. All right. Dirk nodded and continued to eat. After Rita finished talking with him though, she turned to Ava. So, Ava, how's your progress? Gee good. I'm tier 2 and rank 2. Not bad. Now what's your plans for dungeon diving? Are you going to? I think so. Ava answered unsurely. She definitely knew about how they would have the option of fighting in the dungeons next year. The kids in her classes talked about it all the time. But she wasn't sure about making a decision now. She wasn't totally confident in her ability to fight monsters. They were different than people, after all. She wouldn't necessarily be able to apply her training with Dirk. Chapter 27 Special Potion Ava pondered next year and whether she would partake in dungeon dives. Rita didn't seem to be interested in her decision though. Well, just think about it. You'll have to decide sooner or later. Anyway, it's late and I'm tired. I'll be going. Just keep it in your pants, Dirk. You too, Ava. Sigh. Dirk sighed at his sister's concern as she showed herself out. Ava just sat there with embarrassment written all over her face. Here, let me clean. Ah, yes. Wait, no. Let me do it. Ava handed her bowl to Dirk before catching herself and taking over. Dirk just rolled his eyes as she rushed to collect the dishes and joined to help. Once they were done, both went down to the basement to train their mana. After a few months, Dirk had actually made some progress with his mana heart. With his soul becoming stronger and him training non-stop, a faint outline of a mana heart was taking form on top of his physical heart. The formation was plenty slow though, and when Dirk wasn't training it some of the mana would detach from the mana heart and be taken into his bloodstream, a process that reduced some of his progress continuously and would actually dissipate the heart if he didn't train for any long period of time. This meant he couldn't slack at all or the process would take longer than normal. Luckily, he didn't have any problems with slacking. The heart became more and more corporeal by the week, but he didn't have any reliable estimation of when it would be done. He could only form it until he felt the things the book described, like a feeling of completion or solidification. He went through his series of contractions and expansions for an hour. He was able to double the time he could pulse the man heart through all this strenuous training. After that though, he was exhausted and decided to stop. After resting for a bit, he suddenly stood up and left the room. Ava heard this and followed. After going up to his room, Dirk went over to his nightstand and opened the drawer. Inside was a knife, something he had requested from his father. The knife was basic and there was nothing special to it, but after Dirk felt the blade, he nodded in satisfaction. It was very sharp. He grabbed it and then went back down to the kitchen. When Ava saw him with the knife, she tilted her head in confusion. But when he brought over a garbage can and sat down on the chair, her questions were quickly answered. Dirk took the knife and suddenly put it up to his forehead, shaving backward across his scalp. Locks of hair fell off which he dumped into the can. Ava was stunned for a bit, but thinking about it, what he was doing was sensible. When he lost his hair from his anima destruction, it would be uneven. 
Dirk just decided to trim it all as he would rather not do so after he had already destroyed his skin. It only took a few minutes before Dirk was completely bald. Since he shaved dry, his skin was also irritated, but that couldn't compare to the pain of a destruction cycle. Plus, it would be healed quickly anyway once he drank a potion. After that, Dirk headed down to the basement room. He walked over to a corner where the case of potions had been placed and popped it open. The case had been moved here since this room was more secure than the rest of the house. Plucking out a potion, Dirk downed it in one go. The potion tasted slightly sweet, making it very easy to drink. When this happened, the AI understood what he was going to do and isolated the potion for future distribution. With that, Dirk sat down and concentrated. Ava sat in front of him with a frown. She didn't say anything about what he was doing. Dirk needed to do this to advance, and if it were her, she wouldn't let some embarrassment get in the way of her progress. However, she also wouldn't have chosen such a sadistic technique in the first place. She couldn't imagine how Dirk had justified such torture to himself. After saturating the right half of his face with anima, Dirk got started and began the resonation. Ow! He let out a sharp exhale as his skin cells were obliterated. On his face, red cracks started to appear and widen while the previously pale surface of his skin was turned red and made raw. His lips, eyelid, cheek, and scalp were all mutilated. In fact, his eyelid was almost entirely destroyed, leaving a few webs of skin. When closed, there would be gaps that revealed his eyeball underneath. It was incredibly uncomfortable, but Dirk didn't make a peep throughout the process. He didn't even scrunch up his face as that would make things worse. He had perfect control over his reactions to pain. After around 10 minutes, the process finally finished. While Dirk had only planned to do exactly one half, he decided to do a bit more and spill over the halfway point a bit to make things easier later on. The result was a horrific face that people would expect to see on a zombie. Even Ava cringed at how terrible it looked. Like all the other times, she couldn't imagine herself going through the same thing with such tenacity. When the cycle was over, the AI commanded a flood of nanites to enter his face. The gaps in his skin were filled and sealed, including the gaps on his eyelid. The result was hints of gray among the red flesh. Especially on his eyelid, one could see patches of some metallic substance. How is it? Like any other destruction cycle. I'll be fine. Although, my eyesight will be hindered some. Dirk responded simply. It really was like any other cycle, only this time it was much more obvious. Also, the eyelid that was destroyed would remain closed while things healed. The eyelid on the other side was also damaged a bit since it was in the vicinity, but it could stay open without much problem. He was glad he wouldn't be blind for a couple weeks, though he would lose a bit of depth perception. After the Nanites finished their sealing work, he left the room and went to apply some medical bandages. The only thing he did was wrap a bandage around his head over the destroyed eyelid, making sure it stayed closed and didn't move. Not long after that, both Dirk and Ava were bidding each other goodnight. Dirk went to bed that night with the destroyed side of his face up. The next day, when Ava came over for morning training, she cringed at Dirk's face once more. Last night she couldn't see the best since it was rather dark, but now she got a full view of that brutal look. The cringe was out of pity though. She didn't like seeing Dirk get hurt or hurt himself. Though, she also questioned what had to happen to him that caused him to be so tough. His tenacity wasn't natural. Morning training went by normally with Dirk acting like nothing was different. After they ate, both went to school, though not before Ava stressed her mind to find a way to cover his face. In the end, she couldn't think of anything that didn't involve wrapping up his entire head in bandages, so she watched as he left for classes with that single strip of cloth covering his eye. And sure enough, Dirk turned practically every single head that day. Everyone whose eyesight he entered turned to get a better look at him. And seeing the mutilated half of his face, many gasped in horror. Seeing those wounds, none of them could fathom what would cause it. Oh my god. Dirk, what the hell happened to you? When he entered his first class, his teacher practically shouted in terror. 
she flew out from behind her desk and approached Dirk, almost becoming engrossed as she gazed upon the brutal artwork on his face. It's nothing, teacher. Nothing? Say that again and I'll rip a mirror off a wall and bring it here so you can see yourself. What caused this? My training. My face will only remain like this for a couple weeks. What kind of demonic training does this? Is someone hurting you? No, teacher. This is insane. You must be in so much pain. I've already drunk a potion. I'm fine. No, this is not fine. Come on, I'll take you to the doctor. Teacher, I don't need a doctor. If you need someone to reassure you, you can talk to my father. He understands the training I do. Your father? Oh. The teacher suddenly went quiet and stopped. How could she not know Riker Strider, a Marquis who held one of the highest positions in the academy? She knew very well this father of Dirk's, and if he was able to vouch for Dirk, then that was that. Despite knowing this though, she was still worried. Those wounds simply look too horrifying. Are you sure? Yes, teacher. I've been doing this training for over a year, and all of my skin has looked like this at some point in time. It's just been hidden under my clothes. It's only now that you've noticed. I. I see. Thank you. I'll take my seat. Sure. The teacher looked on dumbly as Dirk went to his desk. He had been doing this for a year? All of his skin? What kind of torment has he gone through without anybody knowing? It stunned her silent, and she made a mental note to talk to his father when she got the chance. That class went by with the teacher taking glances at Dirk. All the students also constantly looked back to get a look. Dirk had shut his eyes at some point, just letting everyone look as they pleased. His other classes were no different. His instructor had a similar reaction to the first teacher, except when he saw that Dirk was toughing things out, he laughed proudly. He declared to everybody that Dirk should be their role model and emphasized the importance of toughness. Many of the students agreed with him after taking a single look. As for his magic classes, Dirk explained his way through the earth and fire ones. But when it came to the dark element class, that needed to be handled a bit differently. Well strip me nude and tie me to a magic tower. What kind of abomination could you have possibly come across? I've never quite seen anything like the wounds you have painted on your face right there. Garrel, as enthusiastic as he was in all things, instantly ran over and checked out Dirk's face with the concern of a mother for her baby. He kneeled as if he were praying and even went so far as to accept the existence of light mages if they could perform the miracle of healing Dirk, something that shocked the whole class as they knew very well Geralt's deep hate for the light element. Just how much did this teacher care for Dirk? Dirk had to very tactfully explain how he was okay in order to prevent Geralt from carrying him to the hospital personally. Not even the name of his father could get him to back down because according to his words, not all parents are so loving as to go to the ends of the world for their children. Since they let you get hurt like this, I might just have to punish them myself. Hearing this, Dirk panicked and hastily explained some more. He couldn't have this man fight his father, who was a tier 7. He would die. And Dirk knew that Geral really would fight his father. That's how volatile the man was. It took almost ten minutes to finally calm Geralt down and convince him that he was okay. However, after thinking of something, Geralt suddenly took a step and disappeared from everyone's sight. Dirk could detect a body of darkness in his mana sense quickly leave and dash off to who knows where, obviously Geralt. He couldn't even shout for him to stop, and he had a sinking feeling. What would he do? Dirk wanted to find his father at that moment and warn him. However, after only a few minutes, he reappeared. There was a bottle in his hands which he gave to Dirk. Here. This is a special potion. It'll help you. And no, it's okay. You don't need to give me something so expensive. Oh, it's not mine. Don't worry and take it. Dirk was stunned silly. Not his? Then whose was it? What went on in the mind of this teacher all the time? Dirk was genuinely stumped now. He couldn't understand the slightest bit about this man. 
However, as Dirk hesitated, a roar shook the school. Garol. Where the hell is my potion? Oh. Garol frowned a bit. Even the students could feel the rage in that roar. Ah, here, take it real quick before he comes. Just as Dirk was going to reject the potion, Garol grabbed his shirt and pulled him over, shoving the potion into his mouth. He then used some magic to force it down his throat. Dirk's eyes shot up in confusion and rage as he had no choice but to ingest it. He wanted to stab the man right then and there. Pa! Get the hell off me! Once the potion was in his stomach and Garol loosened his grip, Dirk pushed away from him and got into a combat-ready stance. It looked as if he was about to murder Garol where he stood. Fortunately though, the booming steps everyone could hear in the hallway meant he may not have to. Garol! You good for nothing, shit for brains, limp dick psycho. You don't just enter my workshop and take potions as you please. The doors to the classroom were promptly obliterated. Dirk dodged the shards of wood that came flying at him with agile steps and looked over. A short, pudgy man came stomping in. He had wild blonde hair that stood up like fire and long pointed ears. However, he truly was short. He was only around four foot six inches and was almost rounder than he was tall. He looked like a mean ball of fat. The fact that he was elven shocked Dirk even more. Elves were supposed to look tall and slender. What kind of ironic joke did the gods play on this man? Seeing the angry man, Geralt just looked off into space as if it had nothing to do with him. Naturally, this pissed the fat man off to no end. His face reddened in rage. Geralt! You may have taken potions before, and that may have been more permissible, but not this time. Hand over that potion. If you don't, I will not hesitate to kill you. Aya, I'm so sorry Master Shen. I do not have the potion. What? What's going on here? Suddenly, another voice was heard as two people came walking in. One of them was a mean-looking man with a fierce and deadly aura. The other was the valiant Duke Hillshire who immediately caught attention. Ah! Headmaster! Geralt has stolen another one of my potions. Sigh. Geralt, we've talked about this. Taking the property of others without approval is against the rules. If you keep doing so, I may just let Master Xing here have his way with you. Hearing what happened, Duke Hillshire pinched his nose exasperatedly. Obviously, this had happened more than once before. Seeing this, the onlooking students were stunned silly. Geralt proceeded to complain like a child. But headmaster. My student was hurt and needed immediate attention. I couldn't bear to see him in pain, so I gave him the potion I took from Master Shen. His potions have always been able to heal wounds quickly, after all. You what? You fool. The fat man, Master Sheng, cursed as Geralt pointed to Dirk. Hillshire and Master Sheng looked over to Dirk, but oddly, Master Sheng was trembling a bit. Damn it. You absolute moron. Quick. Get that kid to a medical room. Wait, why? What's going on? The Duke and Geralt both looked at Sheng, surprised and confused. That potion was experimental. It's not a healing potion. It's supposed to enhance the blood source of a tier 6. The energy inside of it will kill him if we don't dash. Cough. As Shing was talking, Dirk suddenly bent over and coughed up a pool of blood, falling to his hands and knees. Blood began to seep from his eyes and ears, even from some pores on his body. He trembled all over. Hurry. Get him mana suppressants. That potion will destroy his bloodlines. Damn. Sheng. Go get something that will help. Thean. Bring him to the medical building. Tell her vet to treat this kid right now. Go! After the Duke gave orders, the man with a deadly aura instantly ran over to Dirk and carefully picked him up before dashing out. Master Sheng also dashed out and ran back to grab some potions. Finally, the Duke left to go grab his friend, Dirk's father. After no later than a minute, these people were all gathered in a medical building. A bed had been cleared off and Dirk's body was trembling on top of it. 
blood constantly seeped out of him, already soaking the bed he was on. However, after a man dressed in a red coat came down from the top of the building, Dirk's situation stabilized some. The man in the red coat looked mature but constantly fatigued. His eyes were sharp as he searched through Dirk's body and utilized his power. White strings of light seeped from this man's fingers and into Dirk's body, and the raging blood and mana inside of him were forcibly settled. Here! These potions will equalize the, my god! Master Shing came running over at that moment with a whole case of potions, but when he saw Dirk, his heart dropped. It looked like all of his blood was trying to escape his body. His usually pale face became totally white. Where's my son? Get out of my way! Suddenly, another shout echoed through the building as another man came flying over with literally blazing steps. His feet ejected flame as he moved faster than the eye could comprehend. In splits of a second, he was beside Dirk's bed. The Duke also appeared the next moment. What the hell happened? Riker spoke with seething rage, but he didn't allow his power to rampage for fear of hurting Dirk. Despite not being the culprit, Master Shin cowered a bit. No matter what, it was his potion that caused this. The man in the red coat, her vet, glanced over for a second before sighing and turning back to Dirk. His white strings never ceased to operate. The Duke explained the situation to Riker. Meanwhile, Dirk was fighting his own battle. Chapter 28, Recovery Back when the potion was forced down his throat, Dirk immediately realized that it wasn't a normal potion. Usually he could isolate substances with the nanites, and he did indeed command his AI to isolate it, but this liquid diffused into his system uncontrollably, totally bypassing the nanites. After that, he was overwhelmed by the raging power held within that potion. The power of the potion surged through every single one of his veins and arteries. This power was pumped through his heart, putting that under pressure as well. After that, Dirk could feel his bones heat up, a searing pain coming from within them. He felt like everything was bursting at the seams as his blood violently increased in volume. The mana in his blood also started to explode out of control. It was like it gained a life of its own as it pulled in the surrounding mana, dumping as much of it as possible into his bloodstream. All these things threatened to obliterate his entire vascular system. However, he didn't just sit idly by and watch it happen. He had heard Shing say that he needed mana suppressants. Secondly, this potion was supposed to do something to his blood source. That was likely the term for the vascular system, so Dirk gave several orders to his AI to reinforce his vascular system, especially the heart. That moment, all the nanites in his body flowed through his veins with his blood and did their best to prevent the surge from damaging things. But the results were limited. He still ended up vomiting and spilling plenty of blood. However, that was only the start. Dirk could feel the insane amount of mana rage through him. While the potion was destroying his vascular system, he could sense that it was indeed attempting to reforge him somehow. It was trying to reforge his entire vascular system into something different. It even seemed to burn his bones, the potion seeping into his marrow and tempering it. However, he couldn't handle it, and it would kill him before the process was completed. So he needed to take more measures. The biggest measure was getting the mana under control and preventing his blood from running wild. To do this, Dirk immediately forced the mana to concentrate in his heart. As blood surged inside of him, he sought to fill it with mana and diffuse it through his system. He employed the mana lungs technique and mana heart training technique to do this, and it had good effects. Dirk's blood began to absorb copious amounts of mana, and he was able to form something of a cycle, maintaining blood flow. However, for some reason, the potion inside of him continued to eject blood. It also continued to try and destroy his heart, veins, and even lungs. Not even his bones were spared. He could only hold on for so long. Over time, Dirk watched as his blood poured out of his body, emptying his vascular system. He felt his entire body and mind become hazy. His blood had been almost entirely expelled. At that moment though, his bones and body began to heat up greatly, and another liquid began to flow inside of him. Dirk felt something throughout him change. Warning! Undergoing genetic change. Employing trait, adaptable genes. Alert! Severe medical state detected. Activating overdrive. With these two notifications, his body underwent changes and was reforged. 
overdrive ensured that he would have the energy to stay alive in the absence of healthy systems. As for the trait that was activated, Dirk had no idea. He had never known what the adaptable genes trait was aimed toward or how it could be used. He had thought it was just there and never paid attention to it. Now though, it looked like his very genes were changing. Dirk became exhausted as he forced his fading mind to use two strenuous techniques. His control over the mana inside him slipped after long. His heart was eroded away, and his veins continued to burst. On the outside, he was completely drenched in his own blood, and his skin had turned black and purple. When that unknown liquid flowed through his body though, he was slowly repaired. First, his chest began to feel revitalized, and then his brain became lucid. His limbs were last to feel any semblance of healthy. Even then though, he was in pain all over. Thankfully, he could take it. This process lasted an unknown amount of time, and Dirk realized that he had fallen unconscious at some point. Despite that though, he retained some lucidity to circulate his techniques to help any way he could. He could feel the blood in him control the raging mana, and anything that couldn't be controlled was exhaled with the mana lungs. It was a cycle of controlling, intaking, and ejecting. The power within subsided. After a long time, he finally felt safer. However, perhaps because of his weakness, all the mana quickly drained out of him. He would have felt like an empty husk if he had been awake. Thus, Dirk entered a deep sleep, his body's natural functions taking over to ensure his survival. After Drick fell unconscious and stabilized, the people around him sighed in relief. Hervet, the man who was treating Dirk, sat back on a chair tiredly. Master Shing also relaxed. However, the Duke and Riker were nowhere to be seen. They were having a chat with Geralt. You son of a bitch. Give me a good reason why I shouldn't destroy your soul this instant. I truly deserve to die, Sir Strider. Geralt was kneeled with his head on the floor in front of Riker. Riker had blue flames surging around his hands, increasing the ambient temperature to that of an oven. Luckily, all the students had been dismissed. Contrary to his expectations though, Geralt didn't try to plead innocent or deny his guilt. After seeing what had happened, he genuinely felt horrible and even wanted to take his own life. Hillshire had stopped him, but with him acting like this, it made it difficult to find a way to deal with him. Geralt had Dirk drink the potion out of pure goodwill. While he had forced it, this actually wasn't the first time he'd done this, as evidenced by how skillfully he forced the liquid down Dirk's throat. All the other times though, the potion had really been for healing, and Shen could have his anger subsided with a bit of remuneration. Now though, it came close to ending with the death of Riker's son. This matter was sensitive. Hilshire was the one who was most conflicted. Riker wanted to have Geralt butchered, but he couldn't be killed so easily. He was still a tier 6. He was a valuable asset to both the Empire and the Academy. Unlike what many students believed, Geralt was a genius when it came to teaching the Dark Element. There wasn't anyone better in the Academy, and Riker had actually arranged for Geralt to teach Dirk's class personally. Geralt had also taught Rita, his daughter. To think things would go this way was out of anyone's expectations. But this time, Geralt was just too chaotic for his own good. Hilshire had to think things through carefully. Riker. Speak. Leave him alive. Riker was quiet as his hand itched to tear out Geralt's heart. Hilshire spoke. He's valuable. You know that. Even if you didn't want him here anymore, he would still be able to fight some battles for the Empire. More than that though, your son still needs to learn the dark element. He's the best one for the job. If my son will even be capable of training mana anymore. Hervet said he's not sure, so we can't jump to conclusions. We'll need to wait. So regardless of what you feel right now, nothing can happen to him at this moment. I understand. Thank you. But there won't be no punishment. Saying that, Riker flicked his hand. The Duke's eyes went wide but when he saw Geralt's arm fall off at the elbow, he sighed and just turned around. Riker also turned and walked out, leaving Geralt who was now gritting his teeth in agony. Afterward, some guards came in and took Geralt away to prison. By the way, as they walked out, Hilshire patted Riker's shoulder. Please talk to your wife. I don't need to receive a report tonight of any assassins breaking into the prison. Don't worry, you won't. He, I see. Hilshire chuckled wryly as Riker walked off. That night, muffled screams echoed eerily throughout the prison. Mmm. -hmm. A low groan was heard as Dirk opened his eyes. 
seeing the unfamiliar white ceiling, his body tensed up and slipped out of the bed he was in, quickly crouching out of view. He completely disregarded the shooting pains that caused. Status. Currently located inside a medical room. Three days have passed since potion ingestion. Current state, combat capable, 91% healthy. Medical room? So I was treated. Dirk calmed down as he processed things. The next moment though, the AI came back with a notification. Alert. Changes have occurred to bodily systems. Magical statuses have also been affected. Constructing host model. Host model. Age, 12 years. Blood type? Skeletal structure, organic iron composite. Muscle structure, high power compacted fibers. Sensory organs, high sensitivity organic receptors. Self replicating nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems, online, 58% capacity. Final stand weapon system, offline. Overdrive systems, online, 11% capacity. Current bodily state, combat capable, 91% healthy. Alert. Final stand weapon system under construction. 64% complete. Insufficient mineral reserves. Intelligence systems fully functional. Awaiting host orders. Seeing this model, Dirk's eyes were immediately drawn to his blood type. Before, it had been AB+. Now the AI couldn't understand what it was. Everything else seemed normal though. Since overdrive had been activated, it didn't have a full charge. It would take a bit to recharge. It also looked like his nanites were damaged. Seeing how much blood he lost though, that was natural. Lots of the nanites had been in his blood. After checking that, Dirk opened his profile. Profile. Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, I+. Rank, 2+. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7. Are you kidding me? Dirk shouted exasperatedly. His tear had gone down from tier 2 to tier I+. While it wasn't a lot, he would have to start over on his mana heart. He had put in so much effort for this to happen. It was unfair. Dirk really didn't like losing progress. He had done so much to finally get the heart to start taking form, but when he looked inward, he couldn't see anything. Even his blood seemed to have lesser mana saturation. He eventually accepted it though. It wasn't like he couldn't start over. At the very least, he could sense and control mana still. That meant that this treatment hadn't disabled him. However. Interface. Awaiting orders. What still needs to be healed? What's the damage? Internal vascular system is still healing. Approximately 10% still has yet to be repaired. However, since your vascular system has undergone changes, the nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems are currently unable to assist in the repair process. Deep scans are underway to adapt to new parameters. It is advised that you remain unmoving until fully healed. Ah, I see. Dirk nodded, proceeding to get back up and slip into his bed again. He felt comfortable laying down as his heart sent tremors through his bed. So what's different about my vascular system? Dirk asked after he got comfortable. If anything, his body didn't feel weird. He actually felt fantastic. His brain felt refreshed and body vigorous despite his not being totally healthy. Three primary changes have taken place on both the physical and genetic levels. All blood cells have been enhanced. Blood cells, per unit, are now capable of passing on 40% more nutrients and energy than before. Blood vessels have changed to accommodate this, and blood vessel density has increased by 34%. Lungs have been altered to process atmospheric gases quicker and more thoroughly to accommodate blood cell enhancement. The heart has also been reformed and is 15% larger. Its strength has increased by approximately 65% to allow higher maximum beat rates and accommodate increased blood circulation. So in short, my stamina has gone up. Your lifespan may also be increased due to these changes as your vascular system has been strengthened as a whole, decreasing chances of heart or lung disease and defects. Right. So why can't the nanites assist in repairs? Deep scans must be concluded to ensure proper integration and cooperation with all cell types and functions. 
genes are currently being analyzed. Estimated completion time, 46 hours. Hmm, interesting. I guess I can take a break for a couple days. Dirk smiled and took a deep breath. He felt like he could run a hundred miles with how much energy he had. And honestly, that might not be far from the truth. He felt his face the next moment. From his touch, he found that his face had mostly healed. He could do another destruction cycle by the time he was totally healed. Until then though, Dirk decided to get started on retraining his mana heart. He was pissed about losing progress, but there was nothing he could do now except do it again. Feeling the mana around him, he began breathing earth and metal mana in and out. His body was surprisingly accepting of all the mana, and he could immediately feel his mana saturation increase. With this, he wouldn't need to take a long time to get back to tier 2. He did breathing cycles for around half an hour, but even then, he felt nothing. No tiredness, nothing. It really was like he was normally breathing. This made him more excited and he simply continued to breathe. However, after around an hour, someone came to his bed unexpectedly. Dirk stopped his breathing suddenly as a nurse laid eyes on his conscious self. Why you're awake? Yes? Dirk tilted his head at the nurse's shock. She stumbled around a bit before going to his side, putting her hand on his forehead and feeling his wrist for a pulse. Steady pulse, no abnormal temperatures. Relax and let me do a checkup. Saying that, a white string of light came out of her finger and streamed into his arm. Dirk could feel this power scan around his body for a bit before coming back out. The nurse nodded, though her surprise didn't lessen. Almost totally healed, except for some light damage. You'll be good in a couple days, it seems. Rest here for a bit. Mr. Hervet will be here soon. Saying that, the nurse left. Dirk only waited for a few minutes before a man walked over. You're a rather tenacious child, aren't you? Tell me, Dirk, how much do you remember? A man in red garments came over and sat down, staring at Dirk with curiosity. Dirk thought about things some before answering his question. I remember being carried by someone to a bed, but my vision wasn't so great so I didn't know where I was taken. I then felt the mana within me calm down over time and I was able to take control of my situation better. Once things were settled though, I passed out. That's about all I remember. Mm, so you really were lucid for all of that. The man, her vet, nodded as he sat back in his seat. He let out a light breath, seemingly exhausted. I must say, even I didn't expect you to actually be able to survive that ordeal. Every drop of your original blood was drained from your body and replaced. Your heart was reformed, as were your bloodlines. Any normal kid would have died once he lost most of his blood, or at the very least have gone into shock. But not only did you resist shock, you actually took control of the raging mana inside of you to save your life. If not for your employing that technique of yours, you would have died a blood-soaked mess. While it couldn't have been done without my assistance in dispersing a lot of the mana, you still saved your own life. I applaud you, Dirk. You've truly impressed me. Thank you. Dirk thanked the man, though inwardly he was wondering why this man was praising him so much. The doctor saw Dirk's weird expression and chuckled a bit. I'm only saying these things because I've never dealt with a situation quite like yours before. Both the situation and you are very interesting. You're a strong kid. Anyway, it looks like you've come back stronger than ever. I expected you to be in a coma for a week or two even with our treatments, but it looks like you'll be back up and running in no time. However, I hope you'll let me do some tests. I just want to make sure there isn't anything unobvious hiding and wait to come back and bite you later. Alright. I actually have a few questions though. Ask away. Her vet welcomed Dirk's curiosity. You said my blood was replaced. What kind of blood do I have now? A good question. The doctor smiled as a string of light was produced from his fingertips, entering Dirk's body not unlike how the nurse did earlier. Master Shen, that fat little elf, was experimenting with a potion that could modify and enhance blood source. Blood source is the marrow within your bones that produces your blood. In order to accommodate the new blood source, all of your blood had to be expelled and replaced. Your veins, lungs, and heart also had to be changed accordingly. Shing had taken several ideas from dragon physiology and was attempting to make something that could replicate their blood and blood source. Not exactly, of course just enough to improve on a humanoid's blood source. The result was the experimental potion you drank. 
the fact that it was experimental was also the reason for it being so violent, though in actuality, Xing had reduced its rampant effects since he himself was going to take it and he doesn't train anima. It was supposed to be resisted by using magic. If it weren't for that, your body would have been thoroughly broken down. Now technically, experimenting with dragons and attempting to make something from their biology is illegal within the empire, but Xin bent the rules enough to get away with things. There are thousands of alchemists who try to experiment with dragons all the time just like him. Anyway, you could say that your blood and blood source are now that of a dragon's, only watered down. According to Sheng, your blood should now be more accepting of mana. It's also more efficient, and you should see your physical abilities improving very soon. Your ability to recover is now also greatly increased. So all in all, you've turned this catastrophe into a boon. While it isn't exactly giving you wings, you're still getting a bit of a boost. I'm interested to see what happens when you begin dungeon diving. When the doctor was done speaking, the strings of light retracted from Dirk's body, and he began writing things down on a piece of paper. Dirk though had more questions. I see. Will anything change for me? In terms of day-to-day -day living? Hmm, I don't think so. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure about every effect that potion has instilled on you. It was still an experimental potion after all. Unfortunately, you're going to have to wait and see. That's why I'm advising you now to come and see me should anything out of the ordinary happen. I've also heard that you're a very active kid. Do be sure to exercise when you're able to understand your new body. Sure. Good. I have everything I need. Your parents should be here any minute now, so I'll take my leave. Thank you. Of course. Bidding goodbye, the doctor left. Not long after, Dirk could see his parents rushing over to him. Chapter 29, Scare Slash Channeling Technique Dirk! Thank the heavens you're okay. Cecilia ran over as soon as she saw him, hugging him tightly. She quickly released the next moment though, forgetting that he still might be hurt. She checked all over his body, stopping at his face and head where wounds from his destruction cycle were still present. How are you doing, sweetie? Does anything hurt still? No, mom, I'm fine. The doctor said I'm almost totally healed. Really? That's good. What about your face? Is this from that technique? To think you need to destroy the skin on your face. It's fine. Doing the face is the last of what I need before I advance to rank 3. So you really are close to advancing. You're doing a very good job, Dirk. Cecilia gave him a kiss on the forehead. Since he didn't have hair, she couldn't ruffle it like she usually did. Dirk and his parents talked for a bit, mostly about his recovery and if he needed anything. Eventually though, Riker brought up the topic of Geralt. Dirk, I want you to decide how to handle your teacher. He looked at Dirk with a serious expression, though he wasn't being serious toward Dirk. He merely felt anger whenever he thought about Geralt. This situation, believe it or not, isn't a new one. Geralt is a young teacher who's been at the academy for around a decade. Even before he became a teacher, he was always known for how chaotic he is. His stealing potions from Master Xing is actually a common occurrence, one that's never been of much consequence. But he's made an irreversible mistake now. Only. He paused for a second, thinking. I'm not at the liberty to decide his fate, at least not completely. Hillshire wants your opinion on whether or not you wish to see him at the academy anymore. If you don't, I can have him ejected at once where he'll go on to fight for the Empire. On the other hand, Geralt is a very good teacher. Hillshire pointed out that you should get the best education available to you. If you should wish, Geralt would go back to teaching you as normal. But if you don't, you will receive a new teacher as soon as you go back. Hearing this, Dirk went silent in contemplation. On one hand, Dirk didn't appreciate how volatile Geralt was. Hearing how this wasn't the first time he's done something like this was actually expected. Geralt was basically insane. The man had no code he lived by, and seemingly no boundaries. He simply did as he felt. Dirk wasn't fond of people like that. On the other hand though, Dirk had to admit how skilled Geralt was. In the short time that he had learned under him, Dirk was able to learn a lot. This was despite being taught without any books or curriculum in general. From Geralt, Dirk was able to understand that the dark element was fundamentally different from other elements. He came to know more about its nature. Geralt's eccentricity actually helped with that. Geralt was someone who lived by the ways of the dark element. One could see the element through him. 
Plus, Geralt didn't mean any harm. Dirk was his favorite student, and Geralt felt strongly about him. Dirk couldn't blame the man for this mistake, even though he was conflicted about how he felt about Geralt himself. In the end, Dirk came to a decision. He didn't want to have a harder time learning about the dark element and he didn't exactly hold a grudge or anything. While he wouldn't allow Geralt to do anything against his will like that again, that was about the extent of his animosity. I don't mind continuing to learn under Geralt. Really? Riker was surprised by his response. Dirk just shrugged. He means no harm, and I'm sure he's learned not to do that again, so I think it's fine. He has also helped me a lot with understanding the dark element. He's worth more as my teacher than as a corpse. That's, right. Both Riker and Cecilia looked at Dirk, surprised by his ruthless and uncharacteristic words. Dirk also froze up a bit, realizing his mistake. Unfortunately, the ship has left the harbor. He just stayed quiet and hoped they didn't think anything of it. Anyway, I'll let Hilshire know then. Let me go talk to her vet and see if Dirk can come home with us. Riker left as he spoke. Not long after, Dirk was allowed to leave, and they went over to his house in the academy. Since it was later in the evening, Cecilia prepared dinner. Rita also arrived at that time, and the family ate dinner together. After dinner though when the family left and Dirk was preparing for bed, a pair of eyes looked down on the house from a hidden place. The eyes were almost emotionless, but within there was a bit of curiosity. It was only around for a little while though before it disappeared without a trace. Two days later, Dirk was walking into class as normal. It had been five days now since he'd been to school. Even then, he had decided to do another destruction cycle, and his face was yet again destroyed, earning him all kinds of stares. But he ignored it and stuck to himself. This time, his teacher didn't question him about anything and acted like nothing was wrong. However, Dirk started hearing some weird whispers this time around. He tuned into all the conversations around him. That's that kid, right? Wasn't he supposed to be dead? I heard he exploded in a pool of blood. His teacher tried to kill him. How is he alive though? I know one of the guys in his class and he said that there was no way he could have survived. And what's up with his face? One of my friends had nightmares about his face the last time he was here. All kinds of gossip was going around and it was as if everyone had learned about who Dirk was. Even some of the older kids were talking about him. People were saying that he had risen from the dead. And Dirk didn't really blame them. He really should have died from all that. How he survived, he didn't know. Everything had just gone right. It was only natural that people assumed he was dead. After first class ended, he moved on to his second. Since it had been two days since his three-day coma, Dirk was refreshed and prepared for all physical activity. However, that became the least of his concerns once he walked into the gym. Ava, who was already there, laid eyes on him and froze up. Seeing her, Dirk frowned as he remembered the one thing he forgot about. He prepared himself for what was to come, but surprisingly, Ava didn't lose control of herself. She simply went silent for the entire class, only nodding to him when he told her he was prepared to resume training in the evening. From there, Dirk went on to go through his earth and fire classes. While he had missed five days of material, it wasn't hard to catch back up. By the end of class, he understood what they were doing. Then came the dark class. For that, Dirk was a little nervous, wondering if things would be different. But when he entered, he was almost relieved to hear that same enthusiastic voice. Dirk! See, I knew he wouldn't die so easily. Everyone, let's hear a round of applause for this tenacious soldier. Welcome home. With Geralt's enthusiastic welcome, the ten students that were present awkwardly clapped for Dirk. He just stood at the front with a neutral face, forcing down all embarrassment as if he were a robot. However, when he looked at Geralt, he was surprised. He lost his arm? Dirk looked at the shoulder stump on Geralt's right side. Dirk thought for a moment before nodding. It must have been his father who did that. Little did he know, his father had only taken off half an arm. It was his mother who took the other half. After that awkward entrance, the class proceeded as normal with Geralt not even acknowledging the missing arm. Geralt went on to diligently teach and spill all the knowledge he knew on dark mana and its nature. In fact, there was one little tidbit that stuck with Dirk that day. The more you understand an element, and by extension, the more runes you can form for it, the easier it is to control. While this doesn't mean much in the lower tiers, upon approaching the higher tiers, it's absolutely crucial. 
one cannot go far without understanding all they can about their element. In this way, hard work can sometimes beat sheer talent. Dirk memorized this line. This told him perfectly why he needed to learn these runes. It was more than just being able to form spells. It was being able to comprehend the nature of the element. With that, Dirk went home for the day. Upon arriving though, he saw Ava waiting outside. The two didn't say anything as they headed inside. Today we should do some high-intensity work. My body has undergone a bit of a change and I need to see just how much is different. What's wrong? Seeing how she didn't respond, Dirk asked. He knew something was off with Ava, but didn't know how off. She was quiet for a bit before sitting on the couch and speaking with a slight tremble. How true were the rumors? Hmm. Dirk thought for a second as he sat down next to her. He had heard plenty as he was walking down halls and listening in classes. Most of what he heard involved how he should be dead. The other comments were about how hideous his face was. People were even starting to give him names. According to the doctor, the fact that I'm alive is a miracle. The potion I drank basically drained my body of all blood and life. Luckily though I was able to hold out long enough for it to rejuvenate me with its effects. If I hadn't been helped so quickly, I'd be a really cold corpse right no dash. Can you not say that? Ava cut him off with teary eyes, and he went quiet. He did notice that he was getting a bit comfortable with his wording. To the emotional Ava, some things may be insensitive. It was an odd thing though, having to accommodate someone's feelings. Dirk just did his best to listen as she spoke. I just, sorry. I was scared. Everyone just started talking about how you died one day, and then you didn't come home. I wasn't sure if it was real or not, but then someone said that one of the teachers was sent to prison for killing a student. And then another person said that there was a medical bed soaked entirely in blood. And, everyone just kept saying you were dead. I, I didn't know what to do. Ava started bawling her eyes out. Meanwhile, Dirk was trying to figure out what to do. He didn't realize that he had such an impact on her. But he also wasn't dense. Since she was crying, he did the only thing he could think of. He moved over and hugged her. Ava leaned into him, staining his shirt with tears. While he didn't apologize, this told her enough. Much of the time, Dirk was a man of action, not words. Like Cecilia, Ava came to understand intuitively how Dirk operated. Because of that, this hug said a lot. It took a minute for Ava to calm down and stop her tears. However, she didn't pull away, instead sinking in a bit deeper. As another minute ticked by, Dirk became increasingly confused and a bit awkward. When was this supposed to end, exactly? Wasn't she fine now? None of this awkwardness translated into action though. In many situations, his mind and body were completely in sync. But in others, like now, they were totally detached. He simply sat there with her in his arms, his mind awkward but body mostly relaxed as if this were normal. Finally, Ava was the first one to break. Dirk could feel her heart rate increase, and her breathing became conscious. She stiffened up as she became aware of every little movement of hers. But she still didn't seem to want to separate. Instead, using her awkward behavior as a cue, Dirk let go. Anyway, I'm fine now, and we need to train. Or are you not up for that? And no. I'm fine. Just, don't scare me like that again. Please? I won't try to. Can't you just say that you won't? Getting hurt in the future is guaranteed, especially if I dungeon dive. I can't promise to never get injured. That's not the point. Enough, let's work out. We can ensure higher chances of surviving perilous situations with training. That's the only real reassurance there is. Dirk spoke as he pulled Ava up by the arm. She just sighed and went outside with him. While he was right, it was nice hearing a bit of reassurance too. The two started training, but Dirk was quick to notice how Ava had regressed in stamina. He attributed this to two things. For one, she likely didn't train for the five days he was gone. Two, he knew that being stressed was bad for physical health. He knew now that his disappearance affected her a good deal. But that didn't stop him from pushing her to her limits. By the end of the workout, she was heaving for breath on the floor. Dirk though was quite the opposite. Even when she was exhausted, he was still doing more and more. It was like his stamina was endless. Why? Huff, how are you still going? Ava looked at him with incredulous eyes. Even when he was in top shape he couldn't go so long so easily. 
but now, it was like he didn't just almost die a few days ago. I told you that my body changed. Although, I'm starting to see a problem. A problem? I can't get tired. How is that a problem? Ava shouted in injustice. Here she was panting like a dog while Dirk was complaining about not being able to. For Dirk though, it was indeed a problem. It wasn't like he couldn't get tired, only that it would take a long time. Dirk wouldn't be able to improve if he couldn't reach his limits. However, after thinking for a bit, he remembered something. Interface. Awaiting orders. What were the results from the genetic scans? Dirk remembered that the AI had done deep scans after his recent change. He was interested in its results. Genetic scans indicate a mass alteration in gene sequencing for bone marrow in the vascular system. These genetic changes have resulted in enhanced overall stamina and enhanced blood delivery systems. The most drastic changes have occurred in the lungs and bone marrow. Your bone marrow is now capable of producing a much greater volume of blood in a short amount of time, and it has greatly enhanced your natural regenerative ability and immune system. Additionally, your entire vascular system has responded well to the infusion of mana, proving to be much less resistant to it than previously. However, your blood has yet to be identified. It has a new type of structure and operation pattern, so it cannot be classified under any previously known category. For now, it remains unclassified. I see. Dirk nodded hearing the diagnosis. It seemed his genes really had undergone a change. This made him think about his adaptable genes trait. This trait had likely allowed his body to smoothly transform under the beckoning of the potion. If it weren't for that, Dirk's body would have likely rejected the potion, and he would have died under its oppressive power. This combined with Dirk's skill usage, Hervit's intervention, and Master Xing's reduction of the potion's physical effects helped to ensure his life. After verifying some more things with his AI, Dirk turned his attention elsewhere. He needed to solve the problem of his workouts becoming less effective. Luckily, he already had an idea of how to do this. Pull up the technique from the Anima Resonance Destruction Technique. Searching. Dirk's AI sorted through his scans of the manual. A few seconds later, Dirk was looking through a page in the book. When he had first read through it, he had no idea what this stuff meant. But now, he could understand and utilize it. As Rita said, his anima manual did indeed have a technique within it. Dirk had planned to start using it, but he didn't expect to have a little sit down with death, so things changed. Now though, he could bring his attention to it. Technically, the first technique within the manual was the whole body resonation. The second technique though was aimed toward physical enhancement. Anima Channeling Technique Utilizing the anima in your body, you can boost and enhance your physical prowess. Not unlike with mana, anima will be expended in the process of enhancement. However, it can be regenerated over time. All sections of the body that have been enhanced will be capable of easily intaking and refilling their reserves of anima. However, any parts of the body that haven't been enhanced will take longer, and they can also be damaged in the process of channeling anima. A way to avoid this damage is to condition your body so that your physical energy can be expended in exchange for protecting your body. This energy expenditure doesn't apply to parts of the body that have been enhanced. Dirk read through the technique. After reading on the details of how to channel anima, he found that it was rather straightforward. It consisted of activating the anima in the part of the body one wanted to strengthen, and if you expended all that anima, you could channel anima from the rest of your body to supplement. It really was similar to magic in that one expended mana for various effects. After reading over the technique and grasping the details, he moved on to trying it out. Dirk activated the anima in his right arm. Immediately, he could feel strength flood his muscles. It felt surreal. Also, since he didn't resonate it with anything, it didn't do any damage to his body. Dirk got a bit excited as he felt that superhuman power. The next moment, he looked down to the ground and swung his fist with all his might. Boom! A low rumble shook the floor, startling Ava. Her eyes darted to his fist that was wrist deep in the ground. What the? What was that? An anima technique. Dirk spoke with even more excitement. When he punched, he could feel how much power was behind his fist. However, he could also feel an energy drain. That single move cost the same amount of energy as a whole half hour of workouts. But Dirk was fine with that. He could do several hours worth of workouts. However, he learned something else after throwing that fist. I can't strengthen only one part of my body. 
If I throw a punch like that carelessly, I'll dislocate or tear something. Hmm, I wonder how I would hold up against the tree. Suddenly thinking of something, he looked around and spotted a tree by his house. Dirk ran over and activated all the anima throughout his body. Every fiber of his being was filled with extreme strength, and he swung his leg at the tree trunk with the force of his entire body behind it. Boom! Crack! Upon impact, the entire tree shook, and it bent sideways. Dirk's shin was like an axe as it cut through half of the trunk that was a foot thick. The tree promptly fell over. Oh my god! Dirk looked back when he heard Ava's voice. She was looking at him as if he were a monster. He just smiled. I figured out how to use anima. I see that. But we haven't learned any anima techniques. It's for my manual. Check if yours has one when you get the chance. Maybe you can use it. It would be good for training. He spoke as beads of sweat formed on his forehead. That single kick took out a lot of energy. He already felt hungry as the fuel in his body was sapped away. He wasn't bummed though. He was excited now that he found a quick way to drain his body of energy. It would make workouts much more effective. Chapter 30 Arrogance After Dirk learned the technique within his anima manual, he went on to train day by day with it. He was indeed correct that this training technique was incredibly efficient. Within only 10 minutes, he would be on the floor sapped of all his strength. This was even after he received the stamina enhancement. He was baffled by it all, but it quickly replaced the way he trained. The only time he refrained from training this way was when he was training combat with Ava. With that, time passed quickly. In only a few weeks, Dirk was able to complete the destruction cycles on his face, though not before he was called plenty of names. Dirk never really spoke or interacted with anyone, and now that he had a face of nightmares, nobody wanted to interact with him. It made him something like a black sheep that nobody went out of their way to be friends with. Naturally though, Dirk wasn't bothered. He barely even noticed the difference since he was never social to begin with. Right when he finished the cycles on his face, his rank went up to three. Now, he had lots of anima at his disposal. He also learned to control his anima channeling technique better, lowering the anima expenditure so that high strengths could be maintained for long periods of time. He immediately determined that this ability was his best weapon. Also, with finishing his skin destruction came moving on to the next section. From rank 3 to 4, he would be destroying his blood. The principle was exactly the same as with the skin. He would destroy blood by resonating anima, and some of the blood would be enhanced in the process. After recovering, he would rinse and repeat. However, there were a few things he would have to do differently. First, he couldn't destroy too much. The book noted that destroying too much blood could be dangerous and even permanently debilitating. He wouldn't actually only be destroying blood, but also his veins. The two would be enhanced together. So Dirk had to take things a step at a time. Second, this wasn't like the skin where he could do a few patches at a time. His blood came in one big supply. After destroying some, he would have to wait for complete recovery. Each cycle would take longer because of this, and lots of energy would be used up in the process of regenerating his blood. Third, destroying the blood was actually incredibly painful. Dirk didn't think it would be painful at all, but after trying it once, he learned that it was worse than destroying skin. The first time he tried it, Dirk concentrated the anima around his forearms, thighs, and neck. These places held major veins and arteries with lots of blood flow, and this was actually pointed out in the book. From there, he resonated the anima according to the book. The anima strictly targeted the blood with its unique frequency, and soon, blood was destroyed. However, that's when the pain hit him like a truck. It felt like lava and needles were pumping through his veins. The blood vessels all through his legs, arms, and head screamed in pain, and Dirk couldn't hold back his own shout of pain. He grunted and trembled as blood disappeared from his body and his blood vessels were cracked just like his skin. Streaks of red matching his veins appeared all over his body. It was only when he lost about 15% of his total blood that he stopped. When he did, he felt a splitting headache and burning all over his body. The pain didn't even stop when he did, and it was a long while before he finally recovered enough to move around. A feeling of low energy and weakness hit him not long after, and he forced tons of food into his stomach to kickstart recovery. According to his AI after that, it would take a few weeks to regenerate all blood and Dirk didn't know how much blood was enhanced. 
the book only told him to continue doing cycles until it no longer hurt. With that, Dirk could only push through without a sense of progress. Luckily, training Anima was only half his focus. Right as he finished off his skin destruction cycles, Dirk was also able to advance in tier. It only took a few weeks to get his tier back up to tier 2. From there, he restarted the formation of his mana heart. However, this time, the process was a bit different. Whenever he would train his mana heart, lots of the mana would be sucked into his bloodstream. This slowed the process of forming the heart, but it was very good at saturating his body with more mana. Nevertheless, he was able to notice how much his vascular system had changed. Even his mana breathing was easier because of the genetic enhancement he was subjected to. His body simply had less resistance to mana and would absorb it willingly. With that, Dirk trained every day. Two more months pass, and the middle of the year comes around. Every year, the school hosted two tournaments where the students would fight each other to test their strengths and form rankings. For a long time, the students in the first-year class were excited to fight and form a hierarchy. However, their excitement was dashed when they received a piece of news. First-year students didn't get to compete. Because they were new and knew nothing about real combat, first-year students weren't recklessly thrown out to battle each other. This could result in deaths if a student couldn't control their power or another didn't know how to defend themselves. They were simply too inexperienced, so they were only allowed to watch their seniors fight in the Colosseum. However, they weren't totally depressed. When the halfway mark rolled around, all their teachers finally brought them out for some practical training. Magic teachers had their students perform live spells all the time, and anima instructors had their students start to learn combat and ways to use their anima. They finally received combat training, and all the students were thrilled to be able to show off their ability. However, when it came to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat training in the anima classes, two dark horses quickly made themselves known. They were Dirk and Ava. Since Dirk had trained Ava for a long time in the ways of martial arts, she was naturally very proficient. And when she was put up against these other students who knew nothing, she destroyed them. One day, when the teacher had decided to have his trainees spar with a partner, Dirk and Ava had automatically gone to each other. After all, they spar and train like this almost daily. However, the instructor had separated them. Boys could only fight boys, and same with the girls. In his words, he didn't want anyone getting handsy. This was a very sensible concern, and Dirk nor Ava had any reason to disagree. Thus, they were arranged partners. Dirk faced off against another similarly sized kid, though this kid was quite a bit skinnier than Dirk. By now, Dirk had ripped and sizable muscles that could be seen clearly just from his visible biceps. To many of the students, he was actually rather intimidating with his cold and dominating air, one that couldn't be brought down by anything. It was like nothing and no one could ever beat him. Though, it also wasn't arrogant in the slightest. He simply exuded strength and confidence, and others couldn't help but shrink away. Of course, Dirk didn't feel like going all out against the kid. Because of that, he took up the position of a teacher and went on with the spar. He corrected mistakes and taught the kid how to properly carry out techniques. Of course, his teaching involved live demonstrations, and the kid was the test dummy. The kid was soon covered in bruises, looking quite miserable. Though, his eyes were fiery. He wasn't at all disappointed or embarrassed. However, on Ava's side, the situation was very different. Ava didn't know that she wasn't supposed to really fight against these kids. She was still a kid herself. Plus, with Dirk's philosophy of being strong in everything he did, she went on to be serious and perform her best. She squared off with her partner, and when the spar started, the partner couldn't even react before she was being thrown around. Bang! Back! A slam was heard, and everyone stopped to turn to the shout of pain. They all saw Ava who had done a shoulder throw on her partner. The girl on the floor had the wind knocked out of her, and she looked as if she were dying. Of course, Dirk had seen the whole thing. He decided he would keep an eye on Ava to see how she did. Seeing the shoulder throw, he sighed a bit inwardly. As for the instructor, he had a much louder reaction. Ava! What's going on? W what? What did you do to her? The instructor ran over and checked on the girl who was catching her breath. The girl was basically crying as a few tears streamed down her cheeks. All the boys felt pity and wanted nothing more than to comfort her. Facing the angry instructor, Ava was a bit stunned. She had realized she went too hard when she threw the girl, but why was the instructor angry? 
she simply sparred with her. And it wasn't like she would die. There was nothing to be angry over. Getting hurt was normal in a fight. I. I just sparred. Yes, but we're not trying to hurt people. They're your classmates. How are we supposed to spar if nobody can get hurt? That defeats the purpose of fighting. Hearing the instructor's ridiculous response, Ava retorted, a slight hint of anger in her voice. She was now questioning whether that man truly served in the military or not. She was also starting to realize how weak her other classmates were. A huge deal was being made over a simple shoulder throw. Dirk's training would hurt many times more, and that stuff went on for hours. Hearing Ava, the instructor seemed to realize the stupidity behind his statement. He went quiet and contemplated for a bit before sighing. You're right, but you seem to be experienced in combat, whereas your classmates are not. Knowing that, you shouldn't be throwing them around like dolls. When they get better and learn to put up a fight, then you can start throwing them around. However, until then, I guess you won't be able to spar with them. Sir. Hmm. At that moment, Dirk walked over. He went up to the instructor and quietly spoke to him. After a few seconds, the instructor's eyes lit up. I see. Very well. Ava, go ahead and spar with Dirk from now on. You two are always together anyways, and I guess both of you are experienced, so go ahead. Okay. Ava nodded with a smile, and the two went off to their own area, leaving their partners behind. As they walked, Dirk spoke to her. Next time, activate your core more. You want to keep your center of gravity stable when performing the throw or you'll throw yourself off balance. Pfft. Ava almost burst out laughing. She expected a scolding or something like a talking to, but Dirk instead corrected her form. She smiled brightly. Despite practicing twice a day with Dirk, she somehow felt that training together in this class was more fun. The class soon resumed after that with everyone going back to clumsily sparring with each other. However, they were quickly distracted once more when Ava and Dirk did their own session. Bang! Slam! Thud! The two threw, kicked, grappled, and punched each other it was like they were really fighting, and the entire class couldn't help but turn their eyes towards them. Their spar was violent, but somehow very fluid and artistic in a way. Both people were incredibly experienced with each other, so they naturally had their way of going back and forth. One moment, Dirk would throw a kick at Ava's thigh and go in for a tackle, but the next, Ava would counter with a knee and take down. They would move from their feet to their knees and then to the floor, dozens of different moves, combos, and techniques being used throughout each series of fighting. Even the instructor didn't know what to say. Dirk and Ava were definitely hurting each other. Just the sounds of slamming bodies and slapping impacts made everyone cringe, but neither person seemed to acknowledge the pain. It made the girl who cried over a single shoulder throw look like a joke, and the girl herself was slack-jawed over what she was seeing. The class eventually concluded with Ava and Dirk practically putting on a show for everyone. Not even the instructor stopped what was happening. He realized that they had done this before as soon as they started, so he had no reason to step in. Plus, letting the students watch the display was good experience. It would make them more eager to fight themselves. While spars didn't happen every day, they did happen around once a week. And every week, the students would watch Ava and Dirk duke it out. Eventually though, the students started fighting themselves, and they were toughened by the fights that became increasingly violent. They didn't want to cry in pain when two people just like them were going through much worse without a peep. Fast forward another five months, and Dirk came up on the end of the year. By now, Dirk had done many cycles of destruction on his blood, but it still didn't hurt much less than the first cycle. Only his ability to tolerate the pain got better. And after so many months of training up his mana heart, there was a rather solid core of mana on top of his heart. The heart formation was coming along nicely. Ava also made lots of progress. In fact, she was able to hit tier 3 before Dirk did. While her anima remained at rank 2, it was still impressive growth. When the end of the year came around though, the entire academy became active. This was because the second tournament of the year was going to start, and this time, first-year students were allowed to compete. Dirk's entire class was excited and doing everything they could to prepare. Everyone trained twice as hard, and the spell ranges were always filled up with people trying to increase their proficiency. Dirk, however, wasn't one of these people. He simply went about his days as normal. This was because he had no intention of competing in the tournament. What? 
Why not? You would do really good. Hearing how Dirk was going to abstain from the tournament, Ava was stunned. The point of the tournament was to test your skills and get ranked above your peers. What kid at their age didn't want to be number one? It was insane that a person as skilled as Dirk didn't want to put those skills to use. There's no reason to compete. I just don't want to. Dirk made up an excuse. The reason he didn't want to compete was because of the experience from his previous life. Not only would it be unfair for all the other kids, but the tournament was filled with just that. Kids. Dirk had a lifetime's worth of brutality and bloodshed, and this little tournament seemed like nothing but a cute pastime. Not only that, but after coming to this world and spending so much time being idle, he didn't have the mood for combat. Sure he still practiced martial arts, but he didn't actually feel like truly fighting anybody. That lifetime's worth of battle seemed enough for him, and he would rather spend his time training himself, something he saw as productive. But of course, he couldn't tell Ava that, so he had to make something up. Why wouldn't you want to? There's no better place to fight. What, do you think you're too good? Yes. Well, that might be true, but that's no reason not to enter. The tournament is more than just fighting your own class. You get to fight the seniors too. Ava spoke excitedly. She was much more enthusiastic about this tournament than Dirk was. All the people she knew from her dorm and her classes were constantly talking about it. It was a big deal for all of them. Dirk just sighed. There was probably no way he could convince her that he shouldn't compete. There was actually no reason for him not to. It looked like he would just have to disappoint her. What's this I hear about not competing? At this moment though, the door to Dirk's house opened, and a person walked through. Both he and Ava recognized the voice. It was Rita. Rita's appearance now slightly surprised Dirk, and not because she appeared from nowhere. She was a bit taller, her face and body mature, and her demeanor confident. She almost seemed like a grown woman, and it was only her face that still maintained a bit of teenage youth. Her long black hair fell down on the back of the gray robe she wore, and her eyes held a certain dark violence within. It seemed she had her fair share of battles. Dirk didn't mind any of this though as he turned to her. Hi Rita. So why don't you want to compete? After Dirk greeted her, she wasted no time and interrogated him. He responded to her with a blank face while she stood opposite to him with her arms crossed. I don't want to. That's not a reason to refrain from fighting. You know, I'm surprised. I didn't think you of all people would be scared to enter. I'm not scared. Then fight. There's no reason for me to. There's no reason for you not to. Enter the tournament, Dirk. It'll be good for your growth. Rita spoke to him seriously, and Dirk had no choice but to go quiet. Why was his sister so adamant about him competing? This tournament was just a little game the kids were eager to play. It would do nothing for him. I'll talk to dad. Okay, now I'm curious. What's up with you and not wanting to compete so badly? Now it was Rita's turn to be questioning. She didn't think Dirk would be so resistant. He usually just went with things, but now he was actively fighting her on this. That didn't happen very often, if ever. It won't do anything for me. Nobody is experienced enough to fight me well. Me doing well would mean nothing, so I would rather just refrain. Dirk responded with a hint of the truth. He couldn't elaborate, but it would hopefully be enough. Unfortunately, Rita was surprised by his answer. The next moment, she sneered. Well that's a lot of arrogance I didn't expect out of you. Dirk, you might be a bit of a genius, but there are others out there. You haven't seen them since you seem to abhor social interaction, but they are there. There are those that have received training from an early age, and those that simply advance absurdly fast. There are also those who can simply comprehend everything about their element in no time at all, giving them a wide range of spells to use. This academy is full of very capable people, so don't get all high and mighty. Arrogance is a very dangerous thing, and it could mean the end of your life if you aren't careful. Rita took on a scary aura as she approached and got in Dirk's face. Dirk simply stood there at attention and let her. However, her words seemed to strike a chord in him. He delved into thought before nodding. I understand. Do you? Then enter the tournament and earn your right to be confident in your skills. Until you put yourself to the test, you aren't allowed to assume anything about your ability. Do you concur? Yes. Good. Then I'll get going. In fact, I'll talk to Dad for you. 
you'll have your spot in the tournament within the week. If you back out, I'll personally hunt you down and beat you into the floor. With that threat, Rita left the house, slamming the door behind her. Dirk sighed. Well now I don't have a choice. But she's right. There's no room for arrogance. I'm also a kid, so if I can't fight those at my level, then I still have a lot to work on. I have yet to earn my confidence here. With that, Dirk took a seat. He and Ava were about to make dinner. As for Rita's surprisingly hostile interaction, Dirk didn't think much of it. She was growing and becoming more mature. By now, she had done many dungeon dives, and she was very capable of killing. Her words came from experience. Only, Dirk had yet to experience what it truly meant to fight in this world. On Earth, everyone was rather equal, and there wasn't a significant separation between the damage people could do with weapons. Skill didn't necessarily secure your life. But in this world, there was an extreme amount of power variation between individuals. Dirk would now have to prove himself. He knew that there was a lot to learn about power in this world. Meanwhile, Ava simply stood to the side the whole time. She was both nervous and excited. Nervous for Dirk, but excited that he would be fighting. Not even she could pull out his full ability, and she could tell that he had a lot hidden. She was eager to see if someone could push him to his best. Chapter 31, Tournament A few weeks pass, and the time of the tournament approaches. Since Dirk was now entered in it, some preparations were made. First, his father came and talked to him about getting a weapon. Everyone had a weapon they used. It was an indispensable tool to have in all forms of combat. Unfortunately, Dirk wasn't sure what weapon he could use. Back on Earth, he used guns. If not guns, he used anything else he could get his hands on. He was proficient with all kinds of weapons and didn't specialize in anything in particular. While Riker didn't know all this, he did know that Dirk didn't have a specialty, so he gave him all kinds of different weapons to look at. Spears, swords, bows, halberds, knives, staffs, and others. Many different weapons with a few variations among them. Dirk looked through them all and found that he could use most of them. Ultimately, he actually decided to use a staff. The staff was wooden with a few engravings along it. Riker was a bit surprised by Dirk's choice. Every kid would jump on the chance to get a cool sword or fancy knife. Staffs looked plain and felt plain. Dirk had a different idea though. He wasn't planning on killing everyone, so a simple stick would suit him well. It was blunt and its slaps hurt like a bitch. The super soldiers were often hit with wooden sticks not unlike these if anyone stepped out of line. However, Riker actually informed him that this wasn't a simple staff. The staff was made with a special kind of wood that was surprisingly hard while maintaining flexibility. It wouldn't snap easily and it was capable of blocking blades. It would easily get him through the tournament. With that, Dirk was basically set. While his father wanted to get him some kind of armor, Dirk told him that he wanted to maintain speed and mobility. If his father were to get him armor, it would have to fit those requirements, otherwise Dirk wouldn't wear any. He was perfectly fine going into the tournament with regular clothes. Dirk! Hey! Are you ready? One early morning as the sun rose over the horizon, Ava came running over to Dirk. Dirk was currently doing some of his meditative movements in his backyard. Even when Ava came shouting, he acted as if he heard nothing. Ava caught herself before he got annoyed and decided to join him. The two did their movements for about an hour, which was surprisingly long for Ava. They usually only did it for half an hour at max. An hour of movements was enough to get her a bit tired. Once they were done though, Dirk stood still like a statue. Ava stopped as well and watched him. Right now, Dirk was at his calmest state, his mind and body in harmony. Ava was practically mesmerized as she gazed upon him. When she utilized her power that could sense the state of people's minds on Dirk, she heard nothing. He was incredibly stable, like nothing in the world could shake him. It was as unbelievable as it was beautiful. This was why Ava was drawn to Dirk. She had never found another person like him. He was a rock in a stormy ocean. Eventually, Dirk opened his eyes. They were serene but sharp, and his body was relaxed but taut. If Ava were to try and kick him right now, he would be capable of responding with ruthless efficiency. It should be about time, right? Huh. Oh, yeah. We should have, only an hour? Crap. We need to get going. Realizing what time it was, Ava started freaking out. 
The tournament started in an hour. Relax. I'm already good to go. Let me just change and grab my staff. Then we'll go. Yes. Hurry. Ava ran over and pushed him along. Dirk entered his house and went to his room. There, he changed into some basic clothes. The clothes were the ones he normally worked out in, some shorts and a simple shirt. Both were fitted to his size, but other than that, they looked very plain. He couldn't possibly wear anything more ordinary. It was because of this that Ava became stunned when he walked out. You're joking, right? Joking about what? Those clothes. How could you wear your workout clothes to the tournament? Are you trying to get laughed at? They're familiar and I can do all forms of activity in them. I have nothing else that's more optimal or preferred. And they don't look that bad. Don't I look nice? W.L. Ava's face became a bit red when he asked that question. She looked Dirk up and down. His muscles were toned, his slightly pale face was handsome, and his hair had regrown to be nicer than hers after he did his skin destruction. Those plain clothes did nothing to hide how good he looked, and in a time where her hormones were surging, Ava couldn't possibly think he didn't look nice. W whatever. Those clothes are fine, I guess. Let's just go already. You can't be late for staging. Ava rushed out, her embarrassment preventing her from realizing how weird of a question Dirk had actually asked. It wasn't very often he spoke like that. Meanwhile, Dirk just smiled. He had recently started teasing Ava, though he didn't really realize he was teasing her. Either way, he enjoyed seeing her cute reactions. This was a fact he wouldn't admit. After he grabbed his staff, Dirk and Ava headed out to the Coliseum. It was only eight in the morning, but there were already floods of people heading into it. The place was bustling. Dirk! Finally! Come over here. Let's get you checked in. As they were walking over, Dirk's father Riker spotted them and called them over. The two hurried and followed him in. Being one of the administrators for the entire academy, Riker naturally had VIP access. The three walked past all kinds of people before arriving at a room within the Coliseum. The Coliseum actually had more than just the big arena. It also had several smaller auxiliary arenas. Riker took Dirk and Ava to one of these auxiliary buildings where they checked in. Dirk Strider. Your first battle is at nine. It will be in this building. You will be fighting a battle an hour after each one you finish. Today, you have four battles scheduled. Head over to the armory stand to get your gear checked. All right. Dirk nodded after getting his information. After him, Ava also checked in. She was going to be competing as well. Dirk then walked over to another booth where a man checked his person. He took the staff and verified it was only wood before patting Dirk down. After seeing that he was really only wearing cloth clothes, the man was a bit surprised, but quickly approved his gear. Dirk was then sent to sit down at one of the stands to await the coming battles. Ava was soon to follow. Are you ready? After Dirk sat down, Riker asked him. Dirk nodded. Yes. Mm, don't be too nervous. Nervousness can actually reduce your performance. Just go out there and do your best. I know you don't have training with the staff, but it also isn't difficult to wield. I understand. Good. And, I know Rita may have put this whole thing on you, but don't be too burdened by it. She just wants you to get a taste of combat. After all, you'll be entering the dungeons for the first time next year. She wants you to have higher chances of survival. While fighting people is different from monsters, there are several principles like keeping calm that will help you in both situations. This will help teach you about that. Understood. Mmm, stoic as always. Just hang out here for an hour. You're actually the first fight here. Once nine hits, I'll be back to watch you. Rita will as well. All right. Dirk nodded, and Riker left to do his own thing. Dirk and Ava were left by themselves. Other kids began to take their seats around them, filing up the stands. Hey! Ava! Ha! Huh. Oh, hi guys. What's with that dull greeting? Don't want us here or something? After some time, there were a couple girls who came walking over. The two greeted Ava and took up a seat next to her. Dirk looked at them curiously. Oh, Dirk, these are my friends. They're also my dorm mates. So this is that Dirk you're always talking about. After Ava introduced the two, one of the girls looked at Dirk with bright eyes. 
This girl had long brown hair and blue eyes. She seemed rather enthusiastic. Hey, Ava talks about you all the time. She's always smiling when she leaves in the morning and comes home at an eye dash. Jessie. I swear if you say another word I will pummel you with a stick. Haha, ha, all right, all right. Just kidding. The girl, Jessie, cowered a bit under Ava's hostile glare, quickly backing off. Meanwhile, the second girl simply looked ahead as if she wasn't related to them at all. Dirk saw Ava's interaction with that Jessie girl and smirked a tiny bit. He was glad to know Ava had more friends and got along with them. After those two girls arrived, they chatted about all kinds of things for an hour while Dirk just sat there. After that though, it was time for the battles to start. Attention all fighters! The first day of the tournament has officially begun. Dirk Strider and Daryl Brown, please report to the arena. Good luck Dirk! After he was called up, Ava and Jessica cheered him on. Dirk grabbed his staff and walked over to the arena. The arena was a large stone slab made up of many smaller blocks of stone. It was rather large, about 20 meters long and wide, and there were no barriers on its edges. Dirk walked up the stairs calmly and approached the referee. Meanwhile, the other competitor jumped up the platform with vigorous energy, taking large strides to the same place. The two were soon stood across from each other with the referee in between. As this is the first battle, I will explain the rules. Both of you will fight until the other is incapacitated or yields. You are allowed to be knocked off the edge once. The second time will result in a loss. There will be no foul play with illegal weapons or items. If any is seen or used, it will result in an immediate halting of the fight and apprehension of the offending fighter. Other than that, you two will fight as you see fit to win. There will be injuries, but there are nurses on standby to treat you. However, there may be injuries that can debilitate or permanently harm you. Facing these is a risk that you understand and face by standing on this stage. Do you both understand the rules? Yes. Yes. Good. Both fighters stand in your corners and listen to my commands. Let's have a good fight, Dirk. Before the two separated, the kid across from Dirk, Daryl, put out his hand. Dirk looked at him for a second before shaking it. The two then walked to their corners. Fighters ready? When the two were in their places, the referee raised his hand. Daryl drew a sword from a sheath on his hip, and Dirk gripped his staff. Seeing that, the referee's hand fell. Fight! Ha! With a shout, Daryl charged toward Dirk. Dirk also moved diagonally, meeting him in the middle. However, before they clashed, Daryl raised his free hand, and a magic circle appeared. Earth! Dirk sensed the element he was using, but that didn't stop him from moving. There were three spells that Dirk knew for the earth element that this kid probably knew too. Rock throw, earth and arrow, or spikes. Dirk watched as Daryl completed the spell, and mana fluctuated around him. Two balls of stone were formed in midair. It was rock throw. Seeing that, Dirk stopped moving and took up a defensive stance, holding his staff like a bat. The two rocks that Daryl formed were shot straight toward him at the same time. Dirk watched them with his eyes and brought back the staff, swinging it. Bang! The staff crashed into one rock, blasting through it before obliterating the second. The rock fragments flew out everywhere. Right when that happened though, Daryl quickly moved again, charging Dirk with his sword. He was planning to catch him off guard. However, Dirk was able to instantly recover after the swing. He spun around and brought his staff back, pointing to Daryl with it like it was a spear. Right when he got in range, Dirk simply thrust the staff forward. Thud. Pooh. Daryl tried to block, but his arms missed the staff. Its end pushed itself straight into his solar plexus, and all the wind was knocked out of him. His body lost all its strength and he crumbled to the floor. Seeing that, Dirk stood straight and walked over, tapping the back of Daryl's neck with the staff as he heaved on the floor for breath. With that, the referee called the battle. The winner is Dirk. His voice boomed, but there weren't many cheers. Everyone was just looking at the arena, confused. That was it. It was an awfully uneventful fight. Dirk just focused on Daryl who was kneeling on the floor, struggling to breathe. He bent down and grabbed his arm, forcefully pulling his whole body up. Stand up and put your shoulders back. You'll breathe better. Huh. When he said that, the kid took his advice and tried to spread his chest as much as he could. His lungs struggled to open as air was drawn in sharply. 
After half a minute though, he was beginning to breathe normally. Thanks. Sure. Daryl spoke weakly, and Dirk nodded before walking off the stage. He went over and took up his seat next to Ava, going back to waiting. The fight only took about a minute. Next fighters to the arena. Not long after, the next two people were called. Ava disregarded that as she looked at Dirk. Good job. It was nothing. Yeah, I guess it was. Two moves. How tired are you? I think it did the opposite of getting me tired. It was a good appetizer. Jeez, so mean. Ava chuckled at Dirk's evaluation. It really was nothing though. He could do that a million times before getting tired. It was so boring that nobody would remember it. However, Dirk actually realized something from this fight. He realized that he would need to start accounting for magic. While he knew this, his mind and body were only accustomed to fighting mechanically, not magically. The use of a spell was actually a surprise. He would need to begin to factor in spells into his battles. After all, he could use his own. So that's what he did. While Dirk waited for his next battle, his mind ran many simulations for how to use the spells at his disposal. He even used his AI. His AI was meant to assist in combat, so he used it to test different combinations of mechanical and magical attacks. This went on for an hour until he was finally called back up. This time, he was against a girl. The girl didn't look like much, but Dirk didn't assume anything. The two took their places in their corners. Fight! As soon as the hand fell, Dirk bounded over diagonally. The girl also jogged diagonally the other way, but it wasn't fast. A magic circle appeared on her hands as they closed distance. She wasn't the only one though. Dirk was also casting magic as he ran. The spike spell was a spell that generated a spike of dirt or stone from the ground, launching it out at a target from below. However, this could be modified. It didn't have to be a spike. It could instead be a pillar. The shape relied on the visualization of the caster and their ability to translate that visualization into a rune to insert into a magic circle. Dirk utilized this spike spell, but instead of a spike, he was going to form a pillar that would launch itself out of the ground. However, he didn't cast it yet. He waited while closing distance. Soon, the girl had finished her spell. Around her, four balls of water appeared. Dirk knew this spell. It was a water ball spell. Upon impact, each ball would burst with power. The pressure being placed on each ball of water was great, so if he got hit, it would leave a nasty bruise. In the worst case, it could break a bone. And that was only with one. The four balls of water were launched quickly after they were formed. Only, they were staggered. Dirk saw this and continued to run diagonally. When the first ball of water came, he swung with his staff. Whack! Boom! When his staff hit, the ball exploded, but there were three more. The second one was soon to arrive, and Dirk swung once more. It exploded as well. However, he wouldn't be able to swing again in time to hit the third as it was close behind the second. It looked like he was going to get hit. Right at that moment though, Dirk activated his spell. A pillar of rock surged out of the ground beneath his foot. Dirk activated his muscles and a little bit of anima, throwing his body at high speeds across the arena. Bang! The third and fourth balls of water smashed into the pillar Dirk launched from, destroying it. Meanwhile, Dirk was several feet away. He rode the momentum of the launch to circle around to the girl. He was quickly on a direct course, and it would only be a few seconds before he was upon her. The girl knew this and panicked a bit, but not enough to keep her from fighting. She immediately formed another spell, and a single ball of water appeared on her hand. She launched it with all her power straight towards Dirk. They weren't that far apart, so it would hit him who was charging head on. As if he predicted this though, Dirk's body suddenly ducked forward. The ball of water nearly sailed over his head as he somersaulted. Flop! After rolling, he recovered to his feet and then swung his leg like a whip. His shin slammed into the girl's calf, and her body was suspended sideways. Thud! Ack! Her body slammed into the floor, and she let out a pain shout. Right when she opened her eyes to get up and fight though, she found the tip of Dirk's staff right in front of her neck. If he wished, he could slam it into her throat. Stop! The winner is Dirk. Before anything else could happen, the referee called the match. Thankfully, Dirk had no intention of going further. 
the girl was angry at herself for losing, but sighed in relief at the same time. Not long after that, waves of pain hit her. She had taken two hard hits, and there was already a bad bruise forming on her leg. After the match was called, Dirk helped up the girl before walking off the stage, sitting back down next to Ava. Good job. Thanks. Dirk smiled at her cheer. He had effectively used magic in combat for the first time. He was already beginning to see its applicability. The endless possibilities were popping up in his mind one by one. Chapter 32 Duel An hour after the second battle, Dirk fought his third. In this fight, his opponent was another water mage. This mage was able to use more water ball spells, but Dirk countered them all. He either destroyed them with his own arrows of rock, whacked them with his staff, or dodged them. Nothing was able to touch him and he swiftly approached and slammed the mage in the stomach with his staff. It ended yet again with his staff point aimed at the kid's throat. Then, an hour later, he went to fight his fourth and last battle. This one was similar to the other three. The only other difference was that this opponent was a fire mage. Dirk was careful as he used walls of earth to block the flames. He didn't feel like getting burned, so he continuously dodged and blocked until his enemy was exhausted. Dirk then went in for the kill, knocking the kid to the floor. With that, he won all four matches. He wasn't even tired, the matches being nothing more than a warm-up. However, this was only the first day. The next couple days would be harder. While he was done, Dirk didn't leave right away. He stayed to watch Ava's fights. She had two more left. Ava had the water attribute, so like Dirk's second opponent, she used many water ball spells to fight. She could also use walls of water to block many attacks. Water was a very versatile element to be in control of, so she was able to win her matches with ease. For her last opponent, Ava was quick to close distance while creating water balls, launching them at her enemy to distract. Once she got in close, she threw a hard fist at her enemy. The fist was backed by a bit of anima, and her enemy keeled under the impact. She then went to the floor and grappled with them, putting them in a lock. I yield. The winner is Ava. With that, Ava also won all her matches. Her usage of water balls and martial arts made her a formidable foe, one that not many could counter. Dirk was likely one of the only people more skilled than her in their age group, and she had reached tier 3, so her mana levels were higher than most. She was prepared to go far in this tournament. Thus, the day was concluded. All the classes were doing their preliminary matches, so there was nothing eye-catching to see. That would come later. For now, Dirk and Ava went to go see Rita. Rita was also competing, and being one of the seniors, her matches were on a whole other level. She had come to see Dirk's matches between her own, so with Ava done, he decided to go see hers. And they arrived just in time. Dirk and Ava entered the room and saw Rita standing in a corner across from her opponent. Rita was now almost seventeen. She wasn't a tall girl, but her looks were stunning. Pitch black hair, developed body, and a face with elven beauty. She was one of the more popular people in her class, and she had the power to fight for a top position. Her opponent this time was a man. Tall with bulging muscles, he looked like a barbarian with a bastard sword on his hip. Dirk activated his mana sense and could see copious amounts of the earth element flowing within him. He wasn't even trying to hide his strength, letting it blatantly radiate. Meanwhile, Rita stood coldly, watching him with her sharp eyes. Unlike the battles of the younger students, these ones were very real. Dirk's first opponent who fought with a sword actually used a dull sword with no blade. Here though, all weapons were real and it wasn't uncommon to come out with life-threatening injuries. Soon, the match started. Surprisingly, it was Rita who charged first. The man stood in place and cast a spell. In two seconds, he was covered in rock armor. While it was only rock, Dirk could sense the dense mana within. It wouldn't be easily broken. After Rita dashed, she cast multiple spells with her hands. Arrows of darkness were created in the air, and they hurtled toward the man. He took out his sword and swung at them. His sword lit up with enchanted lines, and a few of the arrows were destroyed. The others though crashed into him. When they did, Dirk could see the rock armor crack and begin to disintegrate. The arrows were corroding the rock. Rita took steps, disappearing and reappearing in different places. The man couldn't move as she bombarded him with arrows, balls of darkness, and other spells that Dirk didn't know. Even if the man could move, she could simply zip away with her void steps. The man though was as tough as a mountain. He took all the harassment and continuously strengthened his rock armor while trying to counter with his own rock arrows and earthen spells. Any damages to his armor were repaired quickly, and it became a battle of attrition. Seeing this, Rita changed tactics. Chains. She spoke a word, and suddenly, the ground of the arena turned black. 
like ink spreading in water, a domain of darkness was created. Then, black chains shot out from the ground and wrapped themselves around the man's limbs. They destroyed both his rock armor and earth and mana that was strengthening it. Constrict. She spoke again, and this time, serpents of darkness slithered their way out of that dark abyss. They quickly crawled up his body, wrapping around him and squeezing. Everyone could see the man falter and struggle. He was expending all his mana to protect himself. Fighting back was clearly impossible. Rita simply stood a few meters away in front of his struggling figure. He fell to his knees as all his armor was suddenly stripped away, revealing his face that was contorted in agony. Whatever Rita's spells were, they were incredibly painful. I, yield. The man barely spit out those words. When he did, Rita immediately dispelled the chains and serpents. They fell down into the dark abyss, and the arena went back to its normal color. Ugh. The winner is Rita. The man fell to the floor with a sharp breath when he was released. With that, the match was called. Rita didn't bother with the man and walked off the stage, arriving in front of Dirk. Enjoy the show? Dirk stared at his sister's smiling face. That battle had shocked him. From off the stage, he could feel that oppressive darkness. The sheer power behind those chains and serpents was scary. He instinctively felt inferior and defenseless in front of those spells. He knew he couldn't fight against them. Likewise, he would be obliterated by his sister. But how? This sense of powerlessness was new to Dirk. On Earth, there was no such thing. Even at a young age, Dirk was capable of killing practically anyone. But now? It didn't matter what he did. He wouldn't be able to defeat Rita. It was an absurd concept. So this is power. He thought with a revelation. He was starting to truly see what magic was. He received a peek at what individual power could do. With this new power, one could stand above weapons and the forces of nature. Nobody weaker than them could affect them in any way. It simply defied the very concept of weakness. It redefined what strength was to Dirk. It was, interesting. Despite his inner turmoil, he responded to his sister Dolly. Rita smiled. Good. That's the first time you've seen high-level magic, right? I hope it was good enough to give you a wake-up call. That's the kind of stuff you'll be up against in the future. And to think you thought you could beat anyone. I guess you're still young though. It's natural to be a bit naive. Now come on, I'm done for the day. Rita waved them over, and Dirk blankly followed. Ava wasn't much better than him. She had also felt insignificant in front of Rita's power. She was even starting to idolize Dirk's sister a bit. The day passed with Dirk continuously thinking about his magic. Even when he did an evening workout, his mind was running various scenarios in his head. He had ample combat experience from Earth, so he took those memories and wondered what fights would be like if he had magic. The next day, Dirk was up and ready to fight again. He didn't do anything special to prepare for the fights. He believed that the key to performing well was to maintain the state you were always in. If you forced your body into a peak state, it would only remain that way for a short time, after which it would crash. That was dangerous should one be put into prolonged situations, so he had learned to avoid doing that. He simply kept himself at an optimal level. This meant he didn't forsake workouts or training and ate the same things he always did. This day was like another normal day for him. Of course, Ava didn't see it that way. She came over brimming with enthusiasm and nervousness. She couldn't understand how Dirk wasn't at all excited or how he would think to do workouts. Still, when she came over, she joined him in his morning meditation movements. This time, he only meditated for half an hour before practicing with his staff. An hour later, Dirk finished with his morning routines and left the house with Ava. Like the day before, his fight started at nine. He would also be fighting four people again. Dirk Strider, to the arena. It wasn't long before Dirk had checked in and the time for his fight arrived. He walked over to the arena in his plain clothes with his wooden staff. His first opponent was a girl. Short with brown braids, she held a long spear that had various enchanted lines along it. This was clearly a special spear. Fight! Without much suspense, the fight began. Seeing the spear, Dirk knew he had to change tactics. This girl would be strong at mid-range melee, so he had to either get really close or maintain his distance. However, that was about the extent of Dirk's planning. For the rest, he would take things as they came. A plan would form itself in his mind throughout the battle. That was how he usually went about fights. When the hand fell, the girl shouted and charged Dirk, her intentions obvious. While it was a simple move, many avenues were cut off. The spear had long reach, so running diagonally wouldn't do good in keeping him away. It would be hard to maintain distance. However, he suddenly thought of something. 
he remembered that magic existed, and his hand quickly formed a magic circle. Only two seconds later, Earth mana was surging from the ground, and a spike shot out right in front of the girl. Ack! She quickly tried to dodge the sudden attack, but the spike still narrowly scraped her, leaving a cut on her leg. She continued her charge, but was slowed considerably. However, that wasn't the only spike. Suddenly, three more spikes introduced themselves, effectively blocking her from moving forward. She had to stop her charge and maneuver around the spikes carefully. While she was doing that though, some chunks of rock came raining down on top of her. Her head faced upwards and she raised her spear to whack them out of the way. Whack. Thud. Ow. She was able to deflect one, but two others came crashing down on her head and shoulder. A lump quickly formed on her forehead and she was made a little dizzy. She did her best to recover and looked back upward, making sure there weren't any more rocks. When she did that though, a stick suddenly rested itself on her shoulder next to her neck. She froze up and her eyes glanced down, seeing the staff that Dirk wielded. He was behind her. Dirk is the winner. After the two stood there for a few seconds, a shout sounded out declaring Dirk's victory. It was obvious he had won. If he wanted, he could have beat her blind while she was distracted. A hey, chow. The girl asked as Dirk moved to walk off the stage. He stopped before opening his mouth. You were just distracted. My rocks misdirected you. The moment you focused your gaze upward, I won. All right. She nodded as Dirk continued off the stage, but her questions weren't totally answered. Sure she was distracted, but she still had her hearing. How did Dirk move so stealthily? She heard no footsteps, felt no movement in the wind, nothing. And while her head had indeed been facing upward, she still had her peripheral vision. What happened to all of her senses? She had no choice but to walk off though. She had been simply outplayed. It was a rather bitter loss, but she comforted herself with the thought that this was only her first year. She knew she was inexperienced, and this was a good lesson teaching her something very valuable. She would forever remember to never get misdirected like that again. This would likely save her life several times in the future. That was cool. You're really good with magic, you know? Ava clapped for Dirk as he returned to his seat. He let out a light breath. The magic itself wasn't fantastic. It was just used skillfully. Sometimes, a well-placed spike is better than a barrage of arrows. It's all about efficiency and reading your opponent. Hmm, that's not easy though. Hey, how did you get so good at everything? I've been with you for three years and never once have I seen even your mom teaching you anything like this. I taught myself. Really? Ava looked at him suspiciously. Dirk didn't say anything though and just looked ahead with a neutral expression. If he didn't want to, she wouldn't be able to glean anything from him. He was a master at keeping secrets and donning a blank face. Ava sighed and quickly gave up. Never mind. Maybe you're just a genius after all. You make battles look so easy. Fight enough and you'll get there too. I doubt that. You just want to fight with two spells. How will I get that good? Trust that you'll get there eventually. Dirk spoke those words with a bit of thought. He naturally couldn't tell her that he already had several years of extreme combat experience. However, those words he spoke were exceptionally important to making something of yourself. Things couldn't be done overnight. He didn't want Ava to expect anything right away. If anything, this would teach her patience. Ava heard his words and nodded silently. When he thought before he spoke, he usually spit out something wise like that. She remembered what he said and took it seriously. All his other advice had helped her greatly. Dirk's next two fights went just like the first. He used a minimal amount of energy to outplay his opponents, no matter what magic or weapons they wielded. However, when the fourth fight arrived, he was faced with a much different situation than any others so far. Dirk stood at one corner of the arena, facing off against his last opponent. This final enemy was a large boy who towered over Dirk. His muscles were bulging despite his young age, and Dirk could sense odd movements from the air around him. Air Mage. And. Anima Trainer. He was surprised. He had yet to encounter an anima trainer, and this one seemed powerful. He had never even seen this boy before. Rita was right. There really were hidden talents here. One thing actually confirmed that this boy was an anima trainer. He had no weapon, and his fists had calluses. He obviously fought with martial arts, and only people who could train anima devoted themselves to martial arts. It simply didn't make sense otherwise. That was the logic for the people of this world. Fight! Soon, the hand fell. However, the boy didn't charge Dirk like all the other fighters did. He started walking slowly toward him. This is interesting. Without him knowing it, a smile crept up on Dirk's face.
he suddenly felt his blood boil. Clank! Suddenly, Dirk's hand opened, and his staff dropped to the floor. He then walked away without it. The boy opposing him smiled at this. They were thinking the same thing. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. May the best man win. It was a duel between martial artists. While Dirk may have been giving this kid too much credit by thinking of him as an equal, he couldn't help it. Something in him really wanted to fight. He wanted to get hurt. He wanted to bleed. The two approached faster. Walking, jogging, and then running. In only a few seconds, they closed the distance, and the boy made the first move by extending his arms, intending to grab Dirk. Dirk wasn't so easily controlled though. Without hesitation, he ducked out of the way, slithering behind the boy. He then threw out a kick that landed on his thigh. Smack! A loud slap resounded, and the boy's flesh rippled under Dirk's foot. The boy grunted before flipping around, approaching Dirk and throwing a fist. Whoosh! The fist sailed right by Dirk's cheek as he dodged. Dirk, as if he had predicted it, raised his hands and grabbed the kid's arm a second after. He twisted his body, placing his arm over his shoulder and heaving. He even went so far as to activate some of the anima in his body. Slam! The kid's giant body was flung over Dirk's shoulder with a perfect throw. His body landed flat on the ground, sending a tremor through the arena. Arg! The boy once again gritted his teeth in pain, but he wasn't going to give up. His body flipped and he landed on his feet, his body low. Dirk was standing in front of him. The boy looked at Dirk's open hands that were to his sides and couldn't help but feel helpless. You're agile. The boy spoke those words, the first words he's spoken since he stepped on stage. Dirk nodded. Yes. You need to work on that. My teacher says the same thing. Ha! When he spoke, the boy suddenly kicked off the ground, throwing himself toward Dirk in a dive with his arms pointed straight out. Seeing this, Dirk backed up a bit before using his own arms to push the boy's arms away. He then lifted his knee, sending it into his jaw. Clack! Dirk could hear the boy's teeth slam together, and a bit of blood came out. Surprisingly though, the boy didn't stop his charge and wrapped his arms around Dirk. He traded that hit for a chance to finally get his hands on Dirk. His arms constricted powerfully around Dirk's body, and they both went to the floor. Dirk sent out a few punches and elbows, but he was a bit shocked. The boy's body was hard as rock. It was clear that he was a similar rank to Dirk and using lots of anima. As Dirk sent out blows, the boy shifted himself, using his weight to pin down Dirk under him. He then sent out his own punches. Thud. Ow. Damn. The first punch came right toward Dirk's face, but right before it hit, Dirk's head moved and the boy punched the ground. He growled as he felt the sharp pain in his knuckle, but disregarded it and kept punching. Several hits landed, pounding Dirk's face in. The boy even slammed his chest, doing everything with as much power as he could to deal damage to Dirk. However, this only lasted some 15 seconds. In that time, Dirk resisted the impacts with his own anima activation and gradually shifted his body. When he was finally in the right position, he moved. Ha! Dirk thrusted his body upward, getting the boy off of him for a split second. He then curled his knees to his chest, placing his feet on the boy's chest and activating his muscles. Ha! Dirk shouted as he pushed. The boy's body was lifted by that strength and launched in the air, sailing for several feet before landing on the ground. Boom! Ack! The boy grunted, stunned by the impact. He continued to grit his teeth though as he forced himself to his feet. Dirk also got up, and the two entered another standoff. The boy heaved for breath as he spat out some words. You! Fight me! With a shout, he approached. Dirk watched as his fists were raised, poised to punch. Dirk smirked and raised his own fists. They looked like boxers in a ring. Ha! The two met, the boy throwing the first punch. His fist sailed through the air towards Dirk's face. Dirk merely dodged before dipping low and throwing his own fist. Pack! His fist landed on the boy's abs, causing another ripple of flesh. The boy grunted before bringing back his arm and throwing another punch. This time, it was aimed at his stomach. Dirk slightly clenched his jaw with a smile. Bam! The fist landed, sending a tremor through Dirk's body. He had let it hit, and he felt a renewed sense of vigor upon feeling that familiar pain. Fight! Dirk felt his vision go narrow as he radiated fighting spirit. He threw a punch, hitting the boy in the chest. Then, the boy returned his own, slamming Dirk in the side. The two went back and forth. They exchanged hits, their battle becoming one of endurance and willpower. Dirk and the boy threw punches for five straight minutes, never stopping. They both became increasingly fatigued. Even Dirk felt his body struggling. 
this was because of his anima usage that consumed much more stamina than normal. His body was drained of energy as anima was activated, pushing his muscles past what was humanly possible. If he didn't activate anima, sure he could last for hours, but he wouldn't be able to deal any damage to the boy who had muscles of steel. Fortunately, the boy was in a much worse state. Dirk's stamina still reigned supreme, reaching a level the boy couldn't hope to match. At an equal rank, nobody could compete with him, thus the boy gave out before him. The two stood before each other, both of their bodies glistening with sweat, and their skin already showing bruises. They both breathed heavily, but the difference was clear. The boy heaved while Dirk controlled his lungs. One was erratic, the other was steady. The boy threw another punch, landing his fist on Dirk's shoulder. However, it was weak. Dirk sighed before sending his own. The final punch cut through the air, landing right on the boy's solar plexus. Ah! The boy yelled as the wind was knocked out of his lungs. He buckled to the floor, the ground painted wet with his sweat. Dirk stood there and slowly brought his arm back, steadying his body. The battle was finished. Dirk is the winner. The referee called out, cheers ringing out through the arena from the spectators. This fight had been hard fought with both sides beating each other down. Surprisingly, the smaller kid won, but this didn't shock them as much as it would have on earth. After all, your rank determined your strength, not your muscles and size. Dirk calmed himself in his body while nurses came and carried the boy off stage. When he stopped activating anima, a wave of pain hit him, no longer being suppressed by the mystical energy. He felt his body throb. Despite having already enhanced his skin, there were dark bruises everywhere. The boy truly did wield a lot of strength. But despite just winning his battle, Dirk didn't feel any sense of accomplishment or euphoria. After stabilizing his mind and looking back, he scowled at himself. He had been overcome with an intense desire to battle, and it held him back from his greatest efficiency. He should have used his magic and staff, but instead he felt like going to blows. That should never have happened. Hey! Are you okay? As he grabbed his staff and walked off stage with a frown, Ava hurried over and checked Dirk's face. She cringed as she saw purple spots and a split lip. And while she couldn't see his torso, his beat-up arms already told her what she needed to know. Dirk waved it off though. I'm fine. This will heal in a few days. The tournament won't end in a few days. How's your chest? Just a bit sore. Are you sure? Let me see. I'm fine, really. How are you so worried when you've seen me go through destruction cycles? Those are worse than this. Dirk's brows raised as he questioned Ava's excessive worry. Hearing him, she blushed a bit and huffed. I'm just worried. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Then don't question me. Gosh. Just get over here and let's see if we can't heal you up some. She scolded him, turning and hurrying away to a medical bag. Dirk smiled at her before shaking his head and following. Chapter 33, Semi-Finals Hey Dirk! Nice battle! When he walked back to his seat with Ava, Dirk heard Rita's voice. Next to her was Riker, and next to him was Cecilia. Dirk's eyes widened when he saw his mother there. Mom? I thought I would come watch my son's first tournament. I must say, I'm not disappointed. You did well. Cecilia spoke as she walked over and ruffled his hair. The two hugged in greeting before Riker walked over. I'm impressed, son. You handled him well. How are your injuries? It won't impede my fighting. Hmm. That's good. Although I hate to say it, it seems like that anima manual has served you well. Come. Let's go eat lunch. You too, Ava. Oh, that's alright. I'll just head back to my dorm. Nonsense. It's just lunch. You also need to recover from your battles today. Ava was quiet for a bit before accepting Riker's invitation. With that, she and the family left the Coliseum and headed to a residence deep within the academy. It was a place where only administrators lived. This was Riker's residence within the academy, and upon arriving a few maids prepared meals. As they relaxed within the nice house, Cecilia decided to catch up with Dirk. So, how's training coming? It seems like you're becoming proficient with both magic and anima. Hmm. Dirk thought for a second before pulling up his profile. Profile. Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, 2. Rank, 3. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7. The status was as plain as always, but Dirk was pleased seeing the numbers. Even after several months of doing blood destruction, 
he hadn't gone from rank 3 to rank 3. He didn't know how long it would take, but progress was definitely slow. Dirk spoke after assessing himself. The second section of the anima manual is going to take a while, but I'm proficient at controlling my existing rank 3 anima. My first mana heart is also coming together well. It's over halfway finished. I see. That's very good. Your father tells me that you use your magic very well in battles. It seems that your combat sense is rather good. Thank you. Though, I don't remember teaching you any martial arts. Those were some interesting moves you used in that fight. Cecilia smiled as she spoke. Hearing her, Dirk's face went neutral, showing nothing. He came up with a response. I just thought of it. Really? Then I can only say that's impressive. Though. I have a question for you. Cecilia looked at him worriedly. Has anyone approached you recently? Anybody suspicious? No? Dirk shook his head in confusion. Why would somebody suspicious approach him? He was in the academy where nobody could simply enter and exit as they pleased. Something like that was very unlikely to happen here. Unless, there was a certain set of people with those abilities, and reason to do so. Who could his mother be talking about? Dirk's mind immediately thought of spies or assassins. Those people focused on infiltration. However, they wouldn't feel the need to talk to him. He was just a kid. Are you sure? You can tell your mother anything. There aren't many people in the entire world who can prevent me from keeping you safe. I have seen nobody suspicious, mother. The only person I talk to outside of school is Ava. Well, I guess that's comforting. Cecilia shook her head with a sigh, but she was still clearly worried about something. Riker was also frowning, and Rita was curious about what they were talking about. Eventually, their little talk was interrupted by the sweet aroma of food. Everyone headed to the dining room to eat. The meal consisted of tender meat, but Dirk noticed something different about it. It held more mana, tasting richer and rejuvenating him more. He gobbled it up like a starving man. Ava also couldn't help herself after tasting that wonderful food. It was much better than what she and Dirk ate daily. So Dirk, how confident were you in winning against that boy during the fight? Suddenly, Riker asked a question. Dirk swallowed down a chunk of meat before answering. I got too excited and fought recklessly. If I used magic and fought with my staff, I wouldn't have let him touch me. So even with you fighting recklessly, you still won. Looks like it would have been a walk in the park if you fought with everything you had. Yes. Dirk nodded. This was exactly the reason he ended up holding back his skill. He had wanted a fun fight, not a smooth one. He told himself not to do that again, but it couldn't be taken back. He just let it be. Riker announced. Today was your second day, and you're moving on to the semifinals. Tomorrow, you'll be fighting three people. If you win all three, then you'll be fighting the day after for the champion title. Win that, and you'll be fighting one of your upperclassmen. Things will be difficult starting tomorrow. Consider that one boy a taste of what's to come. If you don't stay vigilant, then you'll be blindsided. I understand. Dirk nodded seriously. If his next opponents were harder, then he really couldn't take things lightly like with the boy. Plus, he was beginning to understand something about how fights worked in this world. Combat sense sometimes wasn't everything. Sheer power could surpass all that. If he met someone who could simply overpower him in strength or magic, he would need to be careful. He may be able to avoid getting hit and keep himself safe, but the point here was to win the battle. He needed to be able to hit back and do damage. Thinking that far, Dirk was also curious about facing others who were a much higher level than him. The upperclassmen had an entire additional year of cultivating and dungeon diving. They were all rather experienced fighters with the power to end lives. They would be fierce opponents, ones that Dirk may not be able to win against unless he used absolutely everything he had. Gosh, I think I'm starting to miss Earth. Even as a teen, I could fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with adults. Strength differences weren't so vast that nobody could be touched. But now, there are some people that just can't be harmed. My strength and ability to kill actually has limits now. He sighed inwardly. This fact was dawning on him, and he wasn't sure if he liked it. But, there wasn't any use for whining or regretting. He was still only just a kid, and his ability would grow. That night, Dirk went back to his house and did some mana heart training before going to bed. The next morning, he was up bright and early to do some exercises. Ava was there to join him, even more enthusiastic than the day before. All right. Time to kick some butt. After eating and getting ready for the tournament, the two left the house and went to the Colosseum. Contrary to what Dirk thought, the Colosseum was actually more filled than the previous days. After meeting with Rita and staging, he learned why this was. 
for today, all battles will be fought in the main arena under everyone's eyes. It'll be the same for the finals tomorrow. You guys will be concluding all your battles first, then the second years, and so on. Any other battles that aren't for the championship are going on in the auxiliary rooms. Rita spoke to him before she left. Dirk and Ava were left within some stands on the same level as the arena. There were several other kids there, also competitors. Dirk observed all of them and collected any data he could on their powers. The first battle of the day. Fighters, to the arena. With that announcement, Dirk stood up from the stand along with another kid. The two walked to the main arena. Around them were the main stands of the Coliseum. Several hundred people were watching them, including some of the upperclassmen. Dirk wasn't phased and just focused on his opponent, but the same could be said for the aforementioned. A boy, tall but slender with a cloak on, was looking around with clear nervousness. All the judging and expectant eyes put on a lot of social pressure. He wanted to look good for not only the upperclassmen and teachers, but the girls. Battle starts in five. Four. Three. Soon, the referee started the countdown. The boy zoned in and focused on the fight, but he was still clearly nervous. Anyone who could get this far was talented. However, Dirk was thinking the same thing. The only difference was that he didn't care about the spectators. He was planning on fighting this battle with efficiency. Fight! The hand went down, and the mage opposite to Dirk started casting spells. Turns out, this was a dual attribute mage, and he was using both earth and air magic. Air mages could cast spells like Wind Blade, Air Wall, and an Air Ball that exploded. One interesting thing about their magic was that it was usually invisible since it was air. One had to be able to have great eyesight or read the mana. Luckily, Dirk had great mana sense, and he could see the air mana fluctuate and form wind blades. Just because he couldn't control air mana didn't mean he couldn't see it. With that, Dirk started moving. He knew this boy was both an earth and air mage because Ava had seen him fight before and also because Dirk had collected data on all the other competitors while they waited. They couldn't withhold their mana very well, so he could see what kind of mana their bodies were saturated with. Dirk moved diagonally as the boy stood still. Soon, nine wind blades were formed, and three sliced towards Dirk. Nine wind blades was actually a lot for a kid this age, so he was undoubtedly a little genius. Using an earthen pillar though, Dirk was able to dash out of the way. He then activated some anima and sprinted toward the boy head-on. Seeing this, the boy was happy. He still had a few more wind blades, so he went to hurl them all at Dirk who was getting closer. However, before he could, his body was suddenly slammed from the side, arching his body like a bow. He was sent to the floor, and his wind blades veered off course. Arg! The boy groaned in pain, feeling like he had been tackled from a blind spot. He looked and saw a stone pillar where he used to be standing. It was obvious what had happened. This pillar had slammed into him. Damn. Suddenly, he cursed and turned his attention back to Dirk despite the pain. However, he couldn't see Dirk in front of him anymore. Yield. The boy froze when a voice came from behind. It was Dirk, and he was pointing a staff right at his face. The boy couldn't seem to think for a second, but in that second, Dirk raised his staff to attack. Stop. The winner is Dirk. Before he could bring down the staff, the referee stopped the match. Dirk stopped and backed away before turning around and walking off stage. Wasn't that a bit too easy? When he walked back to the stands, Ava asked him with surprise. He shrugged. He wasn't paying attention. If you aren't aware of your surroundings, then you shouldn't expect to remain unharmed. HM, I guess, but still. That battle was no different from your first. It lasted like half a minute and you only used a pillar. Kinda boring. Boring fights are the best. They're safe, and that's exactly why we train. All right, all right. Ava chuckled a bit at his seriousness. The subsequent fight after Dirk's was a bit more eventful for the crowd. It lasted a while and both fighters battled to the bitter end using all the energy they could muster. However, it was a pain to watch for Dirk. The whole thing was filled with bad choices and missed opportunities. Both fighters were way too inexperienced. But, they were also kids who were only just becoming teens. He understood that their fights would be like this. However, this was also why he didn't want to join in the first place. Sure he had learned some things and had begun integrating magic into his combat, but that was something that could be done elsewhere. He didn't need to participate in something like a school tournament to do this. After that fight ended, the next came. In this fight though, Ava was up, and she was fighting against an animal hybrid boy like herself. The fight started with Ava conjuring some water balls and launching them toward her opponent. She moved at the same time, closing distance. Dirk instantly recognized this. She was mimicking his previous battles. He wasn't at all judgmental of her though. 
he was rather proud if anything. The opponent also conjured his own magic, creating a wall of dirt that blocked the projectiles. Soon after, he moved while making some rock arrows, maintaining some distance from Ava. When Ava went around the wall and tried to close distance, the rock arrows came unexpectedly, and she had to dodge. Unfortunately, not all were outmaneuvered and one scraped her leg, creating a cut. That didn't stop her from running though, and she sprinted toward him. The boy saw this and stopped the magic he was attempting to conjure, turning around and running away. With this turn of events, the two ran around the arena for a bit. People in the stands began laughing a bit at the cat and mouse chase. Hearing their laughs, Ava grunted and used her anima to speed up. Finally, she caught up and put the boy into a hold, choking him out. She only stopped when the boy passed out. The winner is Ava. The referee announced, and Ava reluctantly released the boy. She walked back over to her seat and quietly sat down next to Dirk. Her face was a bit red. Position yourself better next time. Instead of chasing, corner them with your body or use your water ball spells. And refrain from choking the person to passing out. If you're not careful, you'll kill them. All right? She nodded quietly. Having to chase someone down in front of a huge audience was embarrassing, especially with all the laughs. That's why she had put a lot of strength into her choke and made that boy pay for the embarrassment. Luckily, she knew what choking a person did as Dirk had taught her, and she avoided cutting off the blood supply, only preventing him from breathing. Why did he have to run away and make the fight a joke? Ava screamed inwardly at the cowardly boy. If he had just faced her like normal, he could have gone out with some dignity. But that was now lost. Ava could only regret not cornering him better. With that, Ava and Dirk watched the next fights. During that time, Ava decided to treat her wound a bit. Since it wasn't bad, she didn't need to go to the nurses on the sidelines. She could just use some of the bandages available to the fighters. But for some reason, she didn't want to put in the bandages. She looked at Dirk who was analyzing the fight patterns of the kids in the arena. See can you put this on my cut? Huh? Why? I. I just like how you apply them. I don't know how to do it so well myself. Ava spoke with a rosy face. Dirk was confused as to why she couldn't wrap or cut herself, but he didn't really question it before putting her leg across his lap and going to work. When she got hurt during their own training sessions, Dirk taught her how to wrap bandages on herself. Technically she had no problem doing it herself. But Dirk had the experience from his previous life where he had wrapped himself up hundreds of times. His bandages were comfortable, not too tight, and fitted perfectly to stay nice and snug. He didn't expect Ava to be so proficient. After putting her leg on his lap, he looked at the wound. The cut was on her thigh near her hip and had torn through the fitted shorts she wore. He rolled the shorts up her leg until the cut was fully exposed. It wasn't that deep, and because of her anima training, it wouldn't leave a scar. Still, he cleaned it up with some solution that came with the medical package and applied some bandages on it. As he treated her, Ava was trying really hard to withhold her red face and beating heart. Meanwhile, the kids around them were watching the whole thing. The girls looked at Ava with a sneer, and the boys looked at Dirk with a bit of envy. Ava was a very cute girl, so they couldn't help but be jealous. All right. How's it feel? It didn't take long before Dirk was finished. Ava looked at the bandage around her thigh and couldn't help but nod. It was indeed comfortable. But she also was disappointed. It's good. You work pretty fast. It's nothing serious. Right? She nodded and reluctantly removed her leg from his lap. Suddenly, she felt a strong urge to lean against him. Or hug him. She just really wanted to touch him. The desire was almost irresistible. Next fighters, to the stage. That's me. As she found herself leaning closer, Ava was jolted out of her pink reverie when Dirk stood up. She realized his next fight was starting, and she cheered for him as he walked off to the stage. A sense of disappointment welled up in her after that though. She felt a bit of anger toward the referee who just had to call him up now. Chapter 34, Fight Dirk stepped on stage for his second fight. This one was against a girl who wore red robes and looked at him with a ruthless gaze. Dirk just met her gaze with apathy though. The violent aura from a child could do nothing to him. Fight As soon as the hand went down, the girl moved and cast several spells. Eight fireballs appeared above her head, and Dirk's mind started to run. Unlike the other elements, fire was obviously very destructive. Dirk could easily get burned, so he would have to think twice when dodging. Especially fireballs. Those could explode, and their effective radius was large. Dodging may not be possible. Because fire was so destructive, Dirk immediately started moving, even activating the anima in his body. His foot pushed off the ground and he shot toward the girl. Ha! Ah. 
After a few seconds, the girl shot the fireballs toward him. Since he was headed straight on, he couldn't dodge. He instead created a thick wall of rock, loading it with lots of mana. Boom! An explosion shook the arena as the fireballs exploded on the wall. The wall actually crumpled, and Dirk barely jumped out of the way before rock fragments flew at him. He checked out his wall in surprise. Those fireballs had lots of mana in them. Blocking them fully will be hard. But I don't necessarily need to. He thought as he started running again. His body was rapidly expending energy as Anima was used, but this is exactly why he's been training for years. The girl created and launched more fireballs, and Dirk eventually had to create some distance to be able to react accordingly. Then, he created a thin dirt wall. The fireballs hit it, and it was immediately destroyed. However, when one exploded, they all did. That thin wall had taken all the fireballs with it. Ugh! The girl growled in anger seeing that. It was a huge waste of mana to have so many fireballs be blocked like that. Nothing had even hit Dirk, and her mana wasn't infinite. However, she didn't show signs of faltering. Suddenly, she switched tactics, and a different magic circle appeared on her hands. That's... Fire wave? Dirk was surprised as he saw the two-circle spell. Two-circle spells were much more advanced than single-circle spells, and they had equally devastating effects. In particular, fire wave was a spell that Dirk hadn't even learned. Its effect was to cast a tsunami of fire and a cone outward from the caster. Basically, anything in front of them would be engulfed in flame. It cost a lot of mana, but its damage was very real. Dirk saw this and realized that he had to reevaluate this girl. If she was casting these kinds of spells, then she was really smart. Especially since they had only just been introduced to these kinds of spells. Dirk was surprised, but that didn't affect his reactions. Seeing the spell, he immediately thought of what he needed to do. He stopped in place about 15 meters from the girl and raised his staff like a spear. He brought it back and activated a large chunk of anima, precisely throwing it like a javelin. The staff sailed through the air at high speeds. The girl saw this and realized that she couldn't complete her spell midway. With the staff headed toward her, she stopped her casting and tried to move out of the way. Unfortunately, the staff was fast, and it still ended up hitting her shoulder. Thud. Arg. Ow. The girl let out a scream when the staff slammed into her body, sending her to the floor. Because she wasn't an anima trainer, her feeble body wasn't able to handle the javelin with Dirk's immense strength behind it. She struggled for a bit before getting back on her feet and holding her limp shoulder. When she looked up though, she saw Dirk running toward her. As a last resort, she quickly casted two fireballs, but before she could throw them, Dirk was upon her. Whack! Dirk swung his leg around, creating a whipping sound and slamming it into her thigh. The girl was bent sideways before falling back to the floor. Seeing that, Dirk went over and placed his foot on top of her already hurt shoulder, applying weight. Ah! Ow! Get! Get off! Stop! The winner is Dirk! The girl wailed and some tears came out of her eyes as Dirk stepped on her, but luckily the referee called the match. Dirk stopped and backed away, but the girl didn't stop groaning and crying in pain. Both her arm and her leg that was kicked felt like they were broken. Nurses rushed to the arena, taking the girl away. Meanwhile, Dirk simply walked back to his seat without any reaction. Ava looked at him, unsure of what to say. You sure didn't take it easy on her. Anybody can be a threat regardless of gender. Yeah, that's true but why did you suddenly go so hard? You haven't hurt anybody so bad this far. Ava questioned, surprised by his intensity. Besides that fight with the boy where they had beat into each other, he hadn't been so difficult with anyone. Dirk responded dully. She showed that she could cast high-level magic. If I didn't disable her quickly, I would be in trouble. High-level magic? Two-circle. Fire wave. Really? But how? We haven't even studied two-circle spells that much yet. Exactly. She's smart, and a real threat. Huh. Well never mind then. Hearing him, Ava suddenly understood. If anyone could cast that, they would indeed be a difficult opponent. Dirk simply took the best course of action, which was to not give her the chance to cast anything. That throw of his staff was the best way to go at the time. The only other option was to defend or try to run. He also didn't use magic since he was unsure of how long it would take her to cast. After sighing, Ava went quiet for a bit. As she took a look around though, she suddenly thought of something. She spoke to Dirk unsurely. Hey so. I think we might be fighting soon. Us? Dirk suddenly looked at Ava, and then at the stand they were sitting in. There were only a few kids left excluding them. Dirk himself only had one more battle, and Ava only had two. 
after that was the championship fight the next day. Depending on the lineups, Dirk and Ava may end up fighting each other. Seeing that it was very possible to fight each other, he shrugged. Well, if we end up fighting, just fight as if it's a regular opponent. Don't hold back. Hold back? Against you? Of course I wouldn't. If anything, this is a good time to see how well I match up to you. You always beat me in physical fights, but now we can use magic. I'm pretty good if I do say so myself. Ava spoke smugly, and Dirk nodded. She was indeed skilled with water, and she was even a higher tier than Dirk. Her magic could overwhelm him if he wasn't vigilant. Though, both him and Ava knew that he was never one to let down his guard. Next fighters. Alright, that's me. Wish me luck. Good luck. Dirk spoke as Ava skipped over to the arena. Her fight this time was against a boy who, while not looking like much, released quite the powerful aura. Dirk could faintly see some water mana roiling around his body. He felt that this would be an interesting fight since both people had the same attribute. Fight! After Ava was ready, the two went at it. They both instantly casted water balls. Six formed above each head, but neither fired. The two opponents looked at each other awkwardly. Were they evenly matched? This would indeed be an interesting fight. The two eventually launched their spells at each other, and from then on, they constantly exchanged water spells that varied. However, that wasn't the only form of combat. Turns out, this boy was an anima trainer too, so he could fight physically. When Ava went in to throw punches or kicks, he was able to block and return his own. The two would tussle for a bit before backing out and going back to launching spells. The two truly were evenly matched. After a while though, that turned out to only be true for their tier and ranks. When it came to stamina, strength, and technique, Ava was able to beat out this boy. Her punches and kicks hit harder, she could fight intensely for longer, and she could handle attacks better. Everything that she had over this boy came from Dirk's training. She couldn't help but smile even as she was getting hit. In the end, she came out victorious. After the boy got tired, she was able to put him in a hold and force him to tap out. The referee called the match, and she walked back to Dirk. I won. Good job. That was a good fight. Dirk nodded to her as they high-fived. Her training up to this point won her that match. Even Ava realized this, and she couldn't be more proud of herself. This is exactly what all that pain was for. However, when the next fighters went up, both of them suddenly realized something. There were only them and those two fighters on stage left. That meant. Looks like we're going to be fighting each other after all. Ava sighed, and Dirk nodded. Both of their next fights were against each other. Whoever won would fight the winner of this current match. Unfortunately, only one of them would fight for the championship. Well, rest up. This next fight will be hard. For me, yeah. I don't exactly expect to beat you. Anything can happen in a battle. Never believe that the outcome is set in stone. It's because of that that I won't win. Ava rolled her eyes at him. He was basically her teacher. How could she beat him so easily? Everything she knew about combat came from him, and she knew that he was infinitely more skilled than her. She viewed him as superhuman. The thought of beating him in a fair, head-on fight was nothing but a fantasy. With that, Dirk and Ava watched the fight closely. Dirk analyzed the combat patterns of both people, and Ava focused on recovering. She didn't need to worry about the ongoing fight since she didn't believe she would win. She just wanted to do her best against Dirk. Eventually, the fight ended. It was between two boys. The one who won was a tall kid with blonde hair and a valiant look. He wore fancy clothes that weren't optimized for combat and wielded a sword, one that was dulled of course. There weren't many kids who used weapons since none of them knew how to wield any and just used magic, so he was definitely a bit outstanding. After winning, that boy looked over to Dirk and Ava and smiled. He was now going to the championship fight, so whoever won between them would be his opponent. He had seen both people fight, so he was curious, though he already had his own guesses. Next fighters. Dirk Strider and Ava Gamebert. Well, that's us. Hearing the referee, both Dirk and Ava stood up. It was a bit weird that two people so close to each other were now opponents. The two of them now had several rumors flowing around that something was going on between them with how close they stuck to each other. But they didn't mind it too much. It also wasn't like they hadn't sparred hundreds of times before. The only difference this time was the intensity and stakes of the fight. Hey, don't you go easy on me. I'm giving it my best, so give me yours. Ava tapped him with her fist as they walked. Dirk shook his head though. Doing that would kill you, so I won't be. I'll give you a good fight. I want to see how much you've grown over our first year at the academy. Saying that, Dirk smiled at Ava, whose eyebrows raised. 
Like that, they walked onto the arena, into their corners. Ava still isn't in her best shape, so I'll compensate. As Dirk situated himself, he activated the anima in his body. He hardened his muscles and bones, expending anima and physical energy at a fast rate. When the referee raised his hand, Dirk's body was already a bit fatigued. Then, the fight started. Fight! Ha! As soon as it started, Ava raised her hand and formed a spell. Six balls of water appeared above her. At the same time though, Dirk also casted a spell. Four rock arrows appeared above him. Ava launched one of her water balls as soon as it was ready. The ball shot straight toward Dirk. However, it was intercepted halfway by one of the rock arrows which blasted apart the water ball and stuck itself in the ground. Seeing that, Ava launched three more in succession. All of them were intercepted by Dirk's arrows, and all of the arrows stuck themselves in the ground between them like spears. With that, Ava had two more water balls. She launched both at the same time, but at that moment, Dirk shot off the floor as a pillar launched upward from beneath his foot. Both balls flew past him. Come on! Ava didn't care much about the mist spell. Seeing Dirk charge forth, she also rushed to meet him. The two clashed in the middle with Ava throwing the first punch. It was quick and straight, knocking into Dirk's arm before quickly pulling back. Dirk simply maneuvered around as she threw punches or kicks. Most of them were dodged, but the ones that hit didn't do much damage. You left your staff. You really are going easy on me. Ava let out a little growl. She only noticed now, but Dirk never brought his staff on stage. He was fighting her on equal grounds, but she only saw it as a handicap. She wanted to think that he was calling her weak, but she knew him well enough to know that he wouldn't do that. He had other ideas. But that still didn't mean she enjoyed being pampered. Meanwhile, the two went around in this little dance in the center of the arena. Around them were Dirk's rock arrows that were sticking out of the ground. He used those as objects to move around, forcing Ava to use footwork to keep up. Eventually though, Dirk put a stop to the dance. He suddenly counterattacked with a simple punch. That punch caught Ava off guard, but her instincts kicked in at that moment. It was like she predicted it as her body bent, letting the fist sail past. Hmm, good. Dirk nodded and kept moving. Ava recovered and moved with him, going back to that dance. She hit him a few more times, but like with the punch, he countered out of nowhere. This time though, it was with a weapon. As they went around it, Dirk suddenly grabbed the rock arrow in the ground and pulled it out. It was around a meter long, and he swung it around like his staff. Bang! The rock arrow slammed into Ava and shattered on her body. She was thrown away, tumbling to the ground. She felt the side of her body contract with pain as if she were hit with a club, but she ignored it and popped back on her feet. If there was one thing she had learned, it was that Dirk could take advantage of people's low pain tolerance. She couldn't be caught off guard while recovering from a blow. Sure enough, right when she got to her feet, Dirk was right back on top of her with another rock arrow. He swung it around like a bat, and she blocked with her arm. This time, the rock shattered, but she wasn't sent flying. Her body only lowered to the floor. Unfortunately, Dirk pulled out yet another rock arrow, and he swung that one right after. Bang! Ugh! Ava gritted her teeth as yet another rock slammed into her. Her ribs and both arms felt like they were whacked with bars of metal, the bones underneath her muscles being bruised. This was with her rank too, anima as well. She couldn't activate it like Dirk, but it still strengthened her body. That seemed to do nothing though against his strength. After being hit with the rock spears, Ava was hurt, but she wasn't distracted. She dodged Dirk's follow-up kicks and bounded backwards, putting some distance between them. She then cast another water ball spell, for water balls appearing around her. Dirk decided to meet in kind, for rock arrows appearing around him. Zip! Then, the two threw them. Ava's water balls yet again collided with his arrows. Unfortunately, the arrows won, and they also sailed straight to her. Ava panicked a bit as those spears of rock threatened to impale her, but using her instincts, she dodged as best she could. Her body pulled on all its strength, twisting and moving out of the trajectories of the spears. She was quickly in a position of only having to face two, but she couldn't quite dodge those last couple. They came down. Slice. The two rock arrows dug into her leg and side. The first reopened her bandaged wound and made it even worse, and the second opened up a large gash above her ribcage. She grimaced, but was relieved. She at least wasn't impaled. As the rock arrows pierced into the ground behind her, she steadied herself. Blood streamed out from her new wounds, but her eyes were on Dirk. Surprisingly, she wasn't feeling any hostility. In fact, the wounds made her excited. He was taking her seriously. At least, more so than with the other opponents. She was almost happy to have been hurt. 
it wasn't like the wounds debilitated her that much either. Although they were deep, she could still move around, albeit with some pain. However, the fatigue from her previous battle also started setting in. She hadn't recovered a whole lot, so she was more tired than normal. After calming herself, Ava concentrated on Dirk. He was looking at her with an approving smile. Despite that though, Ava felt a sense of danger. She didn't know what was going on, and the alarms going off in her mind only served to confuse her. Then, he moved. Dirk took a step forward, and suddenly, Ava felt the ground underneath her shift. A pillar came out beneath her foot, throwing her off balance. Dirk then sprinted forward. Ava tried to correct herself, but Dirk suddenly cast another rock arrow spell and threw it at her. It was only two arrows, but Ava only twisted herself enough to avoid one. She received another deep wound and tumbled to the floor. Then, another pillar right under her body launched her in the air. She was suspended in mid-air, and Dirk arrived right at that moment. He raised his leg and kicked out, sending Ava flying. Bam! Ah! Ava couldn't help but let out a pain shout and she hit and rolled on the floor. She could barely breathe, her body was screaming, and she struggled to even move. She was truly in pain, and was a bit shocked that Dirk would hurt her so much. The way he did it also shocked her. She couldn't keep up with the rapid changes at all. All of his attacks chained and compounded on each other. Ava pushed up her body while coughing and heaving for air. She looked to where Dirk was, but couldn't see him. She thought it was the massive headache at first, but realized a bit too late that he simply wasn't within her field of view. Get up! A voice came from behind her. Ava heard him and didn't respond as she pulled her body up. Everything was bruised. Her face, torso, legs, arms. Everything was hurt in some way, and she looked horrible. Meanwhile, Dirk hadn't yet been touched the entire time. While he made himself fatigued, there wasn't any point in time where he had to exert lots of energy anyway. He had Ava in the palm of his hands the entire time. Your, how do you do it? Ava asked as she weakly faced him. For some reason, she couldn't even counterattack during the battle. He was too nimble, and it felt like anything she did was futile. He was simply too good. Too experienced. Against him, she couldn't do anything. Over time, you'll learn. Combat sense is hard to teach. It comes from many battles. The training you've done so far is only the groundwork. Only the groundwork. It feels impossible. It's not. Now come on. Keep fighting. What? You can stand, so you can fight. Come on. Ava looked at Dirk like he was stupid. Continue fighting? She could barely stand, let alone fight. She was tired and hurt. She wanted nothing more than to wrap her wounds and be done. She shook her head. But then, Dirk smiled. Fight, or I'll yield. Walk. Dirk spoke, and Ava's eyes went wide. Was he threatening her with his loss? It was insane, but it worked. Ava couldn't help but get angry at him. He was going to throw away all the fights so far simply because of her? He wasn't even hurt, and he was going to lose to her? It was madness. Idiot! You're an idiot! Ava erupted with that anger, and her weakness was pushed away. She dove at him with a fist, throwing punches and kicks as fast as she could. Dirk defended as she pounded him, and he occasionally threw out his own counterattacks. Each one delivered lots of pain to Ava, but she pushed through. For several minutes, Ava did everything she could to deliver blows, even trying to tackle him to the ground. As the fatigue surpassed her willpower though, Dirk ended the fight. Blocking a punch, he suddenly took hold of her arm and bent it around. The two went to the floor as Dirk's body wrapped around her. Ava was baffled as she felt the irresistible pull of her joints and was put into an intricate lock. However, as he took her down, she felt no pain. It was almost like he was cradling her. Only the last pull on one of her joints caused her to grimace a bit, and she tapped out. Stop! The winner is Dirk. At that time, the referee called the match. Nurses rushed over with a stretcher bed, and as Dirk got up, he picked Ava up and set her on the bed. Her wounds weren't light and there was blood in several places around the arena. For the first-year students, this was the bloodiest match yet. Nobody else had been beaten so thoroughly. Dirk walked off stage and left with the nurses, disregarding the determined gaze of that boy who would be his opponent. That fight was tomorrow. For now, he was done, so he decided he would just follow Ava who was being taken to a medical building to get healed up. Chapter 35, Morning Ugh! Ava's eyes fluttered open. Not long after she was carted off the arena, she fell unconscious from exhaustion. Right as she woke back up, she was greeted with a headache. It wasn't too bad, surprisingly. Her body was the opposite though. 
she felt soreness and burning from all her wounds. After she processed the pain of her body, she looked around. Above her was a white ceiling and she was covered in white blankets. When she looked to her side, she saw Dirk sitting in a chair with his head down and eyes closed. Dirk? Hmm? She said his name, and Dirk's eyes instantly opened. He looked up and saw Ava peering at him. Oh, you're awake. Are you disappointed? Ava smirked a bit in his dull response. He shook his head. No, just tired. Tired? Why? Hmm, well, it's three in the morning. And this chair isn't the most comfortable. Dirk spoke as he adjusted his body, popping joints in some places. Ava watched him and processed what he said. Three in the... Wait, what day is it? Our fight was yesterday. Today is the championship. Oh, right. Wait, then why are you here? I was waiting for you to wake up. Come on, we're going to the house. Dirk stood as he said that. Ava had several questions though as she looked at him stupidly. House? Wait, hold on. You have your championship. You should be asleep in your house. I was waiting. You shouldn't have. Your fight starts in like seven hours. That's plenty of time. Now come on. You should be able to walk. Dirk disregarded her panic and waved her over. She pinched her nose in confusion. She couldn't seem to understand what Dirk wanted to do. Why are we going to your house? I can't just leave a hospital anyway. Sure you can. The door is right there. But what about my wounds? I've got a healing potion and plenty of bandages at home. That's why I want you to come to the house. Huh. I'm giving you a healing potion. Now let's go. That. Ava looked at him with a bit of surprise. Healing potions weren't exactly easy to come by, and although she knew he used them, it was to heal from his destruction cycles. Giving her one was a big expense. Plus, they came straight from his parents. It wasn't meant for her. Dirk spoke with a frown of annoyance the next moment, though it wasn't directed at Ava. I tried, but they wouldn't let me bring the potion in here, for some reason. I guess they don't trust a kid with a potion they've never seen before. Anyway, the potion is at home, and you'll heal faster with good food in your stomach. So come on. I. All right. Ava eventually nodded and got off the bed. When she found that she was in another pair of clothes though, she frowned. These were the hospital's clothes. Here. I brought some of my clothes for you. Yours are bloody, and I don't know where your dorm is. They should fit somewhat. Oh. Ava looked at Dirk's outstretched hand and took the shirt and shorts. They were very obviously boys' clothes, but she really couldn't think of a better option. T turn around. HM? Why? Cause I'm changing. Or are you just going to watch me? Ava spoke scoldingly with a red face. Were they so close that she would just strip in front of him? She couldn't help but have fantastical thoughts about it. Oh, right. Realizing his mistake, Dirk scratched his head and made some distance, turning his back. Ava got out of bed and took off her hospital clothes, changing into Dirk's. Her face reddened even further as she took everything off, and she watched Dirk the entire time. He never turned around though, and she sighed when she was changed. All right, let's go. Ava spoke as the waist of the shorts tightened, fitting her. As she took a step though, she grimaced. Moving hurt her wounds, and changing clothes was especially painful. It tugged on her stitches that sealed her lacerations, and flexing her muscles agitated the bruises. Luckily, Dirk's clothes were loose and soft, not making things worse. She smiled at how considerate he was in choosing them. Upon hearing her, Dirk turned around and looked at Ava. He had indeed chosen clothes that would feel the best with wounds. Her shirt was loose, as were the shorts, and both were made from smooth material. It was baggy on her, making it look like the clothes of a bum, but she pulled it off well. Seeing that she was ready, the two walked out. While there was still some activity in the hospital, nobody questioned them as they walked out. Ava was also able to adapt to the pain of her wounds, so she didn't draw any attention by limping. Soon, they were outside and walking back to Dirk's house. The night was dark and breeze cold with nobody outside. They walked the dark pathways side by side. As they did, Ava brought the shirt she was wearing up to her nose, smelling it. She felt a bit embarrassed, but she liked Dirk's scent. You did good during the fight. Suddenly, Dirk spoke. Ava put down the shirt and thought about the battle they had. Toward the end, Ava really was angry. Every day she would imagine what Dirk was capable of and how amazing he was. But when he spoke of dropping out so easily, it made her mad. Unlike Dirk, she placed huge importance on things like the tournament. It was a big deal, and she couldn't understand how Dirk didn't see that. This brought her to another point though. 
How is Dirk, who is only just about to turn 13, so good at fighting? How did he speak as if he had the experience of an adult and soldier? She never really questioned these things that were obviously out of place. Things like where he learned martial arts from, how he was so good at fighting, how his pain tolerance was so high, and how he spoke oddly wise words occasionally. But now, after that battle, she was questioning it. Hey Dirk. Yeah? How, did you get so good at martial arts? Dirk went quiet. This question had been asked before, but he had brushed it off by telling her that his mother had trained him. This time though, it was different. She was questioning that in him too. She knew that there was something else to him. Could he tell her though? That he was someone from a different world? He suddenly wanted to. He wondered how nice it would be to get the secret off his chest. But with that information, he didn't know if he could trust her. The two were close, close enough that he could trust her with access to his home, but this was something quite a bit deeper. But he also didn't want to lie. Dirk thought for a while and eventually spoke. I can't tell you that. Not right now at least. Maybe when we're older. I want to, but it'll have to wait. I understand. Hearing him, Ava nodded. She was a bit shocked that he didn't say that his mother taught him. That meant she didn't, and there was truly something there that she didn't know. But she was also a bit happy. He didn't lie to her, and he wanted to trust her. Like when he gave her the key to his home, this meant a lot to her. The two didn't take long to arrive home. When they did, Dirk immediately brought her to the kitchen. A case was already on the table, and he popped it open to reveal three rows of potions. They were all for healing, and he plucked one out. Drink it. I. Just drink. Sigh. Seeing his determination, Ava sighed and took the bottle. She downed it in one go. When she was done, she looked at the empty bottle in surprise. That tastes surprisingly good. Right? I thought it would taste bitter, but who would have thought? Dirk smiled at her as he agreed. He thought it would taste like Earth's medicine, bitter or sour. But it actually tasted really good. It was sweet, but not too sugary like candy. If he didn't stop himself, he could drink those things like water. All right, now for dinner. Oh, let me help. You're going to sit on the couch and stay still. If you want something to do, massage your muscles and get your blood flowing. Dirk spoke as he dragged Ava to the couch, sitting her down. She looked at him with a bit of a stunned face before looking away, unable to stop a sweet smile from surfacing. While she rested, Dirk went on to cook a large meal for both of them. It took a bit, but when he was done, Ava's stomach growled. She smelled the aroma and could already taste the savory meat. She walked over as Dirk set the table, and the two of them quickly started eating. Ava gobbled everything up, as did Dirk. Both of them had large appetites, and within half an hour, the table was cleared. The two sat back with full stomachs and content faces. That was good. Thanks for cooking. Sure. I've got the correct timing for the meat, so I can cook as well as chefs. That's good. You'll have to teach me next time. The two smiled as they spoke. After a few more minutes, they finally decided to clean up. When everything was washed, Ava prepared to leave and go to her dorm. Well, thanks for the potion. And the food. I'll try and be here in the morning. I definitely won't miss your battle. H.M.? You're leaving? Ah, uh, yeah? To go to my dorm? Yeah, no. Follow me. Dirk shook his head as he waved her over, and Ava followed him upstairs. Aside from his bedroom, there was another door. He went inside and turned on the light, revealing another bedroom. This is the second bedroom for this house. They come with two? Yep. There isn't usually only one person who lives in the house. Anyway, you'll be staying here, at least for tonight. If you want, there are other clothes in my room you can pick out that are meant for sleeping. And no, that's fine. Then go ahead and do what you need. There's a bathroom right there too. I don't recommend bathing right now though. I also don't have another clock, so I'll come in and wake you in the morning. Oh, okay. Can I really sleep here? I wouldn't offer the room otherwise. If there's anything else you need, I'll be in my room. Don't worry about disturbing me. All right. Then good night. Saying that, Dirk left for his room. Ava entered her bedroom and looked around for a while before going to the bathroom and cleaning up. She then went to the bed, slipping under the cool covers. As her body relaxed, she could feel her heartbeat send tremors through the bed. She quickly fell asleep, still a bit fatigued from the day before. Wake up. Hmm. The next morning, Ava's eyes gently opened to the sound of a familiar voice. She found Dirk standing on the side of her bed, shaking her shoulder a bit. Breakfast is ready. Go ahead and clean up. 
Come down when you're ready. Oh. Oh. All right. After taking a few seconds for her brain to boot up, Ava understood and got out of bed. Dirk went down, and when Ava had freshened up, she went down as well. The aroma of food hit her nose, reminding her of a pleasant family brunch. She couldn't help but smile as she found Dirk taking a few bites of food. The two ate in comfortable silence. The food was warm and easy on the stomach, so it served to energize Ava for the day. She found herself thinking about if every day were like this. She wouldn't mind that at all. When they were done, Dirk stood up. All right, come over here. Wondering what he wanted to do, Ava simply nodded before following him to the couch. There, he popped open the potion case and handed her one. Drink. Ava stood there hesitantly, but after Dirk forced it into her hand, she reluctantly drank. The sweet taste did nothing to quell the sense of guilt that rose up within her. She felt like she shouldn't be letting him do this for her. All right, now sit down and give me your leg. Hm. We're gonna change your bandages. Oh. Hearing that, Ava's face suddenly lit up. She did enjoy him applying her bandages. She tried not to let her excitement show though as she calmly sat down, resting her legs over his lap. When he pushed up her shorts though, she got goosebumps. He slowly undid her bandages, exposing the wound and stitches. Ava was curious and looked at it, but cringed when she saw how ugly it was. Ugh, look what you did to me. No wonder it hurts so bad. When we dungeon dive in the future, there will be more of this. You won't scar anyway, and it's only a superficial wound. I suggest you get used to it. Mph. You're so heartless. I will touch it. No. Don't. Ava smacked away his hand that was about to brush over the stitches. Seeing him smile, she huffed and laid back down. Dirk proceeded to clean the skin a bit before applying a fresh bandage. During this, Ava thoroughly enjoyed his gentle treatment. And fortunately for her, there wasn't only one wound to treat. Next was her arm which also had a deep cut from his rock arrow. He did the same thing with it as with the leg. Then came the wound on her side. You'll need to take off your shirt. W wait, what? I need to get to the bandage. Ava went silent at the outrageous request, but Dirk really did need to get under her shirt. Her wound was on her side just under her chest. He couldn't get to it with the shirt in the way. I. Or just take out one arm. Fine. Nodding, Ava pulled her arm out of her shirt. However, even with that, her chest would still be exposed. Unfortunately, the only thing she could do was cover it with her hand. Like this, she let Dirk take the bandage off of her. Her face burned the entire time, and she couldn't help her heart which beat out of her chest. Dirk didn't mind any of that though, only seeing her medium breast through his peripheral vision. He smoothly removed the bandage and exposed the wound. Looking at it, this was actually the worst one. It was deep enough to have exposed her ribs, and it was lucky that none of them were broken. He felt apologetic before cleaning it up. The damp cloth wetted with medical cleaning solution sent chills down Ava's spine. She felt ashamed to be enjoying this as much as she was. Eventually, Dirk had her raise her elbows so he could wrap her back up. He brought the bandages around her torso, completely covering the wound. With that, he was done, and Ava put the shirt back on. T thanks. Sure. With two potions a day and clean wounds, it should heal quickly. Yeah. Isn't that too much though? I can just heal normally. It's fine. Thanks. Ava spoke softly. Dirk didn't say much, but she knew he cared. Was this him worrying about her? Even when he did destruction cycles, he only drank one every few days. This was a large expenditure. Even if he was the one who gave her the wounds, he had no reason to care so much for her. Dirk nodded and was about to stand from the couch, but Ava stopped him. Pulling his hand, she quickly brought her lips to his cheek. Dirk was surprised as he felt her warm breath on his skin. She slowly backed away, not as flustered as she thought she would be. I just... As a thank you. I'll pay you back someday. I don't do this expecting to be paid back. I know. Just... I want you to know that I'm not using you. Or taking advantage of you. Well, I guess that's not the best way to express that. But... I'll show you. When I can. Okay. Dirk nodded slowly, but his mind was filled with the kiss. That felt nice. He couldn't help but be dazed a little, his guard lowering significantly. He wasn't sure what this feeling was. He just really wanted more of that. Unfortunately, he had to rein himself in. So, we should get ready to leave. The battle is in 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Wait, 20 minutes? Then why are we still here? So we could treat you? You need to get to your battle, dummy. 
Saying that, Ava shot off the couch and pushed Dirk up to his room. He looked at her weirdly before going into his bedroom and changing. When he came back out a couple minutes later, the two went for the door. We're going to stop by your dorm on the way there. You need to get to the arena. And you need a change of clothes. If you want to make it in time, then hurry along to your dorm. You. Ugh. Come on. Ava huffed at him frustratedly before stomping off. He smiled before following. A few minutes later, Ava shot into her dorm while Dirk waited outside. The first thing she saw were her dorm mates who were getting dressed. Ava? Oh, hi guys. Ava. Hey, are you okay? Where have you been? Her friends rushed over to her, looking her up and down. She smiled as she cursed inwardly, wishing for her friends to get out of the way so she could get changed. I was in the hospital. I'm fine though. Hospital. Ugh, that asshole friend of yours. How could he hurt you so badly? H. Hey. It was a battle. People get hurt in battles. He did nothing wrong. Ava, you don't need to defend him. Look, just stop hanging out with that guy. I know it must hurt to have discovered how two-faced he was. He didn't try to do anything else to you, did he? No. Just, be quiet, will you? Ava, you need to stand up to him. You're beautiful and talented. If you want, we can teach him a lesson for you. It's time to unchain yourself from that sadistic piece of horseshit. Ack! Just let me get my clothes. As her friend refused to listen, Ava shouted and pushed her way through the dorm. She hurriedly took out some of her clothes and threw them on, all the while her friends continued to talk smack about Dirk. Eventually, she hurried out and slammed the door behind her with a red face. Her shame increased when she saw Dirk's smiling face. I. I'm sorry. They just dash. It's fine. Your friends seem nice. It's not bad to have people who will fight for you. I I guess. Let's just get to your fight. Ava grabbed his wrist and quickly pulled him out of the dorms just in case her friends decided to chase her. Luckily, they didn't, and they too rushed to the arena where Dirk would fight for the championship. Chapter 36 Championship Dirk Finally Where have you been? Upon arriving at the arena, Dirk and Ava ran into Rita. Although she asked the question, she didn't wait for an answer as she walked them straight to the check-in. After that, Rita took Ava to the stands while Dirk went to the ground floor. So this is my opponent. Dirk looked at the boy he saw yesterday who had already been waiting in the staging area. Today he was in blue clothes with his silver sword that hung from his waist and his swept back golden hair. He was a good-looking kid, valiant not unlike Duke Hillshire. Maybe that's who he was trying to resemble. As usual though, Dirk was apathetic to everything except for his actions and abilities. Around the boy, he could see the fire element, as well as another element that he didn't recognize. This other element was bright, full of vitality and structure. After a bit of thinking, Dirk recognized it as the light element. He was surprised. Dirk had come to understand how rarity worked among the attributes. Earth was the most common attribute, water was the second, air the third, and fire the fourth. Each successive element was rarer than the last, and fire was a very rare attribute to have. He heard that only 14% of mages have the fire attribute, while the rest had the other attributes. And this was only among the ones with a single attribute. Having only a single attribute was obviously most common, with over 85% of all mages only having a single attribute. Then, only 14% had two attributes. That last percent was made up of all mages with three attributes. As for those with four, they were counted individually, and those with more than four attributes were nothing more than legends. For Dirk to have three attributes, he was already in the top 1% of all mages. The reason more attributes was so amazing was because it allowed many more spells to be used. The combat ability and versatility of the mage would increase countless times. Plus, some believed that having more attributes was an indicator of superior talent. Although there were studies to dispute those claims, many accepted it as truth. And not only did Dirk have three attributes, but the fire and dark attributes were two of them. The fire attribute was rare enough, but the dark attribute was even rarer, standing at the top couple percent of all mages. The only thing that surpassed the dark and light elements in rarity was having three attributes. 
From the words of Dirk's eccentric teacher, Geralt, his combination of attributes along with his ability to train anima was possibly the most destructive combination that one could be given. Should he train everything, nobody would be able to beat him in the ability to kill or destroy. Geralt had shivered at the thought of Dirk mastering all his attributes. He likened him to a god of destruction in training. While Dirk didn't understand Geralt's thoughts, he had to acknowledge how rare his skill set was. However, with his knowledge of his previous life and how he had gotten here in the first place, he had an idea that this wasn't much of a lucky draw. He felt that there was something else to his situation that he didn't quite understand. Otherwise, he wouldn't have retained his AI and cybernetic enhancements. Dirk Strider and Alec Desmodius, to the arena. Suddenly, Dirk snapped out of his thoughts. His battle was the first one of the day, and he was being called. He glanced at his opponent before walking calmly to the arena. Hey! Dirk! Let's have a good fight! As he walked though, Alec, his opponent, caught up to him. He put his hand out, a sign of his sportsmanship. Dirk didn't think too much before shaking his hand with a nod. The two then walked to their corners and prepared for battle. Fighters ready? The referee raised his hand. All around them, crowds were chattering or cheering. While the whole Colosseum wasn't full, many of the earlier students were present and watching the two fighters with interest. Especially the first years. They had all arrived and were excited to see who would take the championship. This person would be the strongest in their class. Rankings had already been formed, so this battle would complete it. This was why Ava couldn't understand how Dirk didn't care about the tournament. Social hierarchies were huge in this school. Dirk was antisocial, but she wasn't. She had come to understand how the school worked, and being strong gave you many things. The tournament was the way to prove yourself, to establish your place among your peers. It earned you respect and gave you influence. If Dirk took the championship, he would be the greatest in the class, and even the students of the upper classes would need to show him some respect. But he just didn't care. It absolutely baffled her. Even as she watched him from the stands, she couldn't help but think about how little he thought of the battle he was in. She knew that for him, it was just another training session. He didn't even want to be there in the first place. And she was right. Fight! The hand went down, and the battle started. Alec drew his sword and cast some fire spells. Dirk cast a spell of his own, and a pillar appeared underneath his foot. The anima in his body also activated. Alec smiled. I've seen this before. You use this move a lot. He shouted, but Dirk ignored him and dashed. Soon, Alec's fire spell completed, and seven fireballs appeared above him. Dirk didn't stop moving though, only casting a spell above his palm. Alec threw a few of the fireballs, but Dirk responded with a rock wall. The fireballs exploded in front of it, destroying the wall. But Dirk was already gone by the time the dust settled. He continued closing distance. Alec continued to throw fireballs, forcing Dirk to keep creating walls. Alec could cast spells fast, so Dirk never rested. However, after he kept flying around using his pillars, Dirk eventually got close enough. He swung his staff at Alec. Ha! Clang! Seeing him swing his staff, Alec swung his own sword. The two collided, and it was then that Dirk realized that Alec could train Anima too. He had strength on par with Dirk's. You're strong. Machem. Dirk hummed in response to Alec's surprise before backing up a bit. The two then swung their weapons a bit more, both colliding quicker and quicker. Dirk was able to swing his staff faster, but Alec merely had to defend so he was able to keep up. After some time though, Dirk began to grasp Alec's habits. He adapted. Bang! Ow! Suddenly, Dirk's staff made its way to Alec's shoulder. His grip loosened and he stumbled. Seeing this, Dirk moved in for close quarters. Before he did though, he suddenly ducked back. Whoosh! Alec's body twisted, and his leg came swinging around like a whip. He had used the imbalance from Dirk's strike to shift and perform a kick. 
usually this would catch an opponent off guard since they would move in for another strike, but Dirk was able to dodge. Wow. You're good. Alex spoke with a grin seeing Dirk react and recover so fast. Meanwhile, Dirk's mind was re-evaluating Alec every second. This was how Dirk carried out battles. He would read his enemy, grasping his strengths and weaknesses, and then adapting accordingly. Everything they did only gave Dirk information on how to handle them better. And then, if he read them well enough, he could destroy them. He would turn the battle into his favor, leading everything like a conductor. The enemy would play toward their own doom. However, there weren't many people who could force him to fight long enough for that to happen. At least, that was on Earth. Here, things were different. Now even children were forcing him to think twice. It was all because of magic and anima. He always questioned whether or not he liked it. Luckily, his combat experience still applied, and it gave him an almost insurmountable edge. Dirk and Alec seemed to be even, but it was only now that Dirk had learned enough to begin destroying his opponent. Dirk and Alec reset, both facing each other with their weapons. Suddenly, Dirk charged toward Alec again, and they fought. Dirk bombarded Alec with blows, and Alec couldn't seem to counter. Dirk's attacks chained together perfectly like a dance, and Alec had to constantly defend. Alec suddenly wasn't so giddy anymore, and he was focusing seriously on the fight. Then, something unexpected happened. A pillar came surging out of the ground right as Dirk pressed an attack. Alec sensed it, but his body couldn't move out of the way. He was pushed by Dirk into the pillar with a dull point on it. The point came crashing right into his back. Ack! Pain suddenly surged through Alec, and weakness threatened to overtake his body. However, he gritted through it and at least didn't collapse. This was only possible because of anima. Otherwise, he would have crumpled on the spot. Alec's body twisted and barely recovered after being poked. He then weakly raised his sword to block Dirk's sudden blow. Unfortunately, if he wasn't at peak shape, he couldn't stop Dirk. He was bombarded all over his body with jabs and wax. The bruises accumulated. For some reason though, he was still able to stand and take the hits. Dirk was wondering how his endurance was so high when he saw a flash of light over Alec's body. This was light magic. He's healing himself. Dirk recognized it. Light magic could heal, and light mages could easily heal themselves. While Alec couldn't heal himself that much, it was enough to keep him going. Even the lowest level spells had decent effects but that would only prolong the battle. Dirk sped up while calling more pillars. Alec was hit from all sides as Dirk's movements became more unpredictable. Whenever Dirk would push Alec a certain direction, there was always a pillar waiting to strike like a hidden snake. And when Alec would try to push, a pillar would be waiting to intercept him. Alec became a punching bag as he was continuously beaten up, and the worst part was that he couldn't seem to ever dodge or fight back. The situation became worse when some rock arrows came, and he received real wounds. Finally, when Alec was exhausted, Dirk came in personally after tossing away his staff. He chained a few punches straight on Alec's body and jaw before kneeing him in the gut. Then, he did a roundhouse kick, his foot slamming into Alec's shoulder like a hammer. He was ruthlessly sent to the floor, unable to even twitch a muscle. Stop! Dirk is the champion! With that announcement, cheers erupted. Dirk's fantastic attacks had made everyone's blood boil in excitement, and that last attack sealed the deal. Alec had been no more than a punching bag. He had been utterly oppressed by Dirk once his habits were grasped. Some nurses came running on stage, quickly taking Alec away. Before Dirk could leave as well though, a beautiful lady approached with a trophy. Congratulations, Dirk. You're the tournament champion of your first year class. Here. Oh. Thank you. Dirk accepted the trophy that was handed to him. It was small and held a little wooden carving of two swords crossed together. He thought it was nice, but it held no value. This would be worthless in half a year when the next tournament came around. With that, he walked off stage, everyone in his class remembering his name and face. 
when he made his way to the stands, Ava was first to greet him with excitement. Good job. Now I'm not the only one who will suffer from your attacks. Ah. Uh -huh. Oh, is that the trophy? It looks nice. Yeah. Here. Without much thought, Dirk handed the trophy to Ava before walking over to his parents who were nearby. Ava looked at the trophy for a bit, but soon realized that he had just given this to her. Would he want this back? Knowing him, probably not. She decided she would keep it though, considering it a present from him. Dirk! You did great, honey! Cecilia smiled and clapped, giving Dirk a celebratory hug when he walked over. Riker also nodded in approval. Although not everyone competed, you're technically the strongest in your class. You beat that kid rather easily. I must say, you're talented in combat. That's because he's got his mother's blood. Isn't that right? Cecilia smiled. Dirk knew she specialized in anima training and physical combat, so he couldn't help but nod. If the excuse of genes was enough to convince them that there was nothing weird about him being good at fighting, then he would roll with it. However, despite his parents not saying anything, he knew that they were wary of something. After that night when his mother asked him about meeting suspicious people, he knew that they were curious about his unnatural fighting ability. They just didn't want to directly confront him about it since in their eyes, he really was only a kid. He also never did anything out of the ordinary, and his schedule was so cyclical that a clock would be impressed. There was simply no explanation for his ability in combat other than sheer talent. But they didn't seem entirely convinced. Even now, Dirk could see some conflict behind his mother's smile. He genuinely wondered what she was thinking about, but didn't pry. After Dirk's battle, the championship fights for the upper classes started. Dirk watched his seniors, but other than the more advanced spells, he wasn't that interested in the fighting. However, he did notice how much more adept his upperclassmen were. Even the kids in the year above him were leagues better than his own class. This was attributed to the dungeon diving they had been doing for a year. They knew actual combat. Suddenly, after a couple battles, Rita stood up and left. Dirk looked at her with a bit of surprise before nodding. She was going to fight for the championship. She quickly arrived on the stage. By now, the entire arena was filled with spectators. These fights between the upperclassmen were the most exciting since they were between the most powerful students in the school. Right now, Dirk learned that his sister was one of those most powerful. Soon, the battle between Rita and another student started. There was no suspense before both were going full force. Rita constantly flickered in and out of view as she void walked, putting distance between her enemy. She also cast several high level spells that Dirk couldn't understand. He simply watched as the arena became a prison of darkness. However, her enemy wasn't to be trifled with. The man who wore armor that glowed with enchanted red lines pulled out a spear and spat fire like a dragon. He elegantly slashed at all of Rita's spells and burned them away as if they were demons of darkness. His heavenly fire seemed limitless, and even though he was surrounded, he wasn't at all disadvantaged. He was even capable of keeping up with Rita's movement, forcing her to void walk non-stop to avoid being hit. Neither person's energy was limitless though. After almost an hour, the two showed signs of tiring. Rita's magic was a little less dark and oppressive, while the man's fire burned a little less bright. The two slowed, but their wills weren't any less fierce. If anything, the climax was beginning. When Rita got a moment of rest, her hair suddenly flared with black fog. The surface of the arena turned completely black, and even the spectators were engulfed with black fog that spread from her person. Domain of Darkness Cecilia spoke as she smiled, watching her daughter with a proud face. Riker wasn't as happy though. He seemed to be worried about something. Domain of Fire Suddenly, from the darkness shone a warm light. A tornado of fire pillared to the sky and pushed away the darkness. At first it seemed weak, like a small sailboat in a stormy sea, but it quickly strengthened until it actually gained the upper hand. Dirk could see his sister struggle to push away the fire that began to overwhelm her. And she wasn't able to hold on for long. 
the man let out one final blast of fire, and Rita was blown off the stage. Stop! The winner is Trent. With that, the referee stepped in with an announcement. The domain of fire was pulled back, revealing the man with armor. He kneeled on the floor while heaving for breath, not in much better shape than Rita who was almost passed out. I'll be back. Suddenly, Cecilia stood up and disappeared from beside Dirk. He looked at the spot she was at curiously. Where did mom go? People like your sister who exclusively use the dark element aren't compatible with light element healing. Your sister needs dark healers to help with any wounds, but they're very rare. Luckily your mother knows some dark healing, so she's going to help. Hmm. Dirk listened to his father and made a mental note of what he said. The light element was known for its fantastic healing properties, but those with the dark element weren't compatible with the element that was opposite to theirs. It would harm Rita to be healed by the nurses or doctors present within the academy since they were all of the light element. Normally she would have to recover naturally over a long period of time, but if there was someone like Cecilia who could use dark healing, then she could be helped. It's a serious disadvantage but then again, not many have the dark attribute in the first place. They're simply too rare for it to matter that much. But it looks like it's something I'm going to have to worry about. Is it only for those with an exclusive dark attribute? Dirk pondered, but his father saw his concern and spoke. You have the dark element, so even though it's not your only attribute, you will indeed need to worry about regular healing. People with an exclusive dark attribute just have it worse. However, since you're not a high tier, it doesn't matter much right now. It's only when the attributes within you become stronger that the dark element begins to have effects on you. Your sister is a tier 5, and she's only just beginning to have troubles with that. If you want to know more, I suggest going to your mother. She understands the dark element much more than I, obviously. Understood. Dirk thanked his father for the information. It didn't look like it would be a problem for quite a while, but it was something that he would have to keep in mind. After that battle, there was one more. Two more people entered the stage, both of whom were in the class above Rita. They were both older and looked more like adults who had experienced hardship. Their auras radiated with determination. Fight! The hand went down, and they both dashed to each other. One utilized the fire element, while one used water. The two clashed with the highest level spells that were a level above Rita's. The spells attacked each other as if they had lives of their own. Then, like Rita's battle, both people eventually released their elemental domains. Water and fire clashed, releasing fog all over the arena. This fog had thick enough mana to block Dirk's senses. Usually, Dirk would have taken the opportunity to intake the thick mana, but there was only water mana within the steam. All the fire remained around the man. After a long time, the domains finally saw a change. The water domain overwhelmed the fire, crashing down on its opponent. The fire user was washed away, leaving the water user standing. With that, the battle was called. Dirk sat there with emotion, starstruck by the display. The domains were even stronger than in Rita's battle. They were on a level that Dirk couldn't even begin to understand from where he was. This was true power, and Dirk was inspired by it. Chapter 37, Break After the battle was over, Dirk left with Rita to his house. Though, not after being briefed on the next day's fights. The battles didn't stop with the championships. When all champions were decided, the champions of each class would go on to fight their upperclassmen. Dirk didn't really understand the purpose of this, but after his dad talked to him about how beneficial it would be, he decided he would just go along with it. He could tell that his dad really wanted him to fight as well. His opponent would be one of the top 30 in the class above him. He obviously couldn't go and expect to beat the champion of the class ahead of him, so they picked out one of the weaker kids. They were still strong though. They had a whole other year to cultivate their tears and plenty of combat experience to strengthen their abilities. Nobody ever expected anyone to be able to beat someone a year ahead of them. These battles were really only for entertainment, maybe a form of hazing for the younger years. Dirk went home that day and just continued on with his routine though. 
things didn't stop just because of a battle. He cultivated his mana heart before practicing his mana lungs technique. His tear grew by the day, and mana lungs got progressively closer to actual breathing for him. He also helped treat Ava, something she thoroughly enjoyed. When night came, he had her stay over. She wanted to go back to her dorm out of respect for his parents, but he said that he would only let her when she healed a bit more. Eventually, they agreed on three more days. Like that, the two ate dinner and went to sleep. Why won't you let me help you with breakfast? You're healing. Doesn't matter. Wake me up next time. Ava huffed as she sat down at the table. Dirk had made breakfast as she slept. The only reason she woke up was because of the smell. She didn't enjoy him not letting her help. It's not like I can't function. These wounds are only superficial. And do you think I can't take a bit of pain? Your training hurts more than this. My training doesn't leave wounds. It's only for a few days, so deal with it. Whatever. It's good though. Thanks. Ava smiled a bit as she tasted the broth he made. Both of them got better at cooking over the year and could now make dishes as good as what they ate at home. Especially Dirk. He had everything down to a science, and he was able to teach Ava a few things like what to look out for. The two ate for a while before Ava pushed Dirk out of the kitchen so she could clean. He rolled his eyes before heading upstairs and getting ready for the fight. When he returned, the two left the house and headed for the arena. The arena today was much emptier than normal, only half of the students there. Everyone really only wanted to see the battles between the best in each class. However, these battles between classes were also entertaining, so many still came. Many of them also didn't have anything much better to do. Upon arriving, Dirk was sent to stage. The seats where competitors waited only had six people there. Going by age, Dirk was able to pick out his opponent. A boy dressed in a red cloak and leather armor with scales on it. He wasn't much taller than Dirk, and it didn't look like he had done much physical exercise, so he wasn't an anima trainer. The boy also looked at Dirk who went to sit down. His face sported a mean look, apparently not happy with something. Maybe it was the fact that he was chosen to fight a child who didn't deserve his attention. He would rather be anywhere else, preferably in the stands. Dirk didn't mind as he relaxed on the bench. However, it wasn't long before the fight started, and he was the first up. He and the boy stepped up to the stage, taking their corners. Dirk Strider, ranked first in Class 1, versus Peter Toll, ranked 32nd in Class 2. Fight! With an announcement, the hand went down. With it, Dirk immediately moved, his foot pushing off a pillar of earth. He shot toward the boy, who stood there relaxedly. When Dirk got close, he formed a spell, and five rock arrows quickly formed around him. They shot toward the boy one after the other. They also spun around in weird patterns, making it difficult to track them. However, when they got close, the boy raised his hand. A thick rock wall formed in front of him, and the arrows shattered on it, only leaving small nicks on the stone. Seeing that, Dirk went around the wall, throwing out more arrows. The boy put up yet another wall though, chuckling at how easily he blocked Dirk. Dirk continued to dash around, throwing more and more arrows. Eventually though, the boy had erected walls all around him. Dirk stopped and stared at the little fortress the boy created. Go ahead and break in. If you can, of course. The boy chuckled from inside the walls. While Dirk could climb over, that would be asking for a rock to the face. He didn't worry about the taunting of the boy though as he pondered. Suddenly, he thought of something. Dirk formed a spell, earth mana gushing out of him. With his partially formed mana heart, his earth magic was the most developed. However, he was now using almost everything he had. This was the first time he had employed so much mana for any single thing. With that mana, the tops of the walls warped inward, forming a dome. The boy watched as the light from the outside was cut off and his mana was driven out of the walls. He smirked and didn't think much of it. What would closing him in do? However, the next moment, the boy felt the temperature around him go up. Sweat beaded on his forehead, and he finally frowned. 
Meanwhile, Dirk was outside with his hands close to the walls. On top of his palms were many balls of fire, and they were all cooking the walls. The rock turned red and yellow under the heat. He was turning the rock enclosure into a furnace. Hey! What are you doing? The boy within the rocks yelled out as the heat became unbearable. It became hard to breathe, and he wanted to get out. Forming several rocks, he bashed them against the walls. However, it took a while before they cracked. Dirk had reinforced them with all his mana, and despite being an entire tier above Dirk, the boy had to put in some effort to break it. Bang! Eventually though, a wall broke, and the boy burst out from the enclosure. Right when he did so though, a leg came hurtling toward his face. He couldn't react before the foot slammed into his head, knocking him out instantly. Stop! The winner is Dirk. With that, the match was called. Dirk took a few deep breaths as he felt his head throb. He had expended a lot of mana in a short amount of time. Luckily he trained a lot, so it was nothing he couldn't handle. Dirk walked back to his seat. The other kids looked at him with surprise. It wasn't very often that another kid could beat someone a year ahead of them. Dirk didn't think it meant much though. This guy just underestimated him. Hey kid. Dirk right? As he sat down, one of the other boys moved over to him. Dirk looked over and was surprised. It was the teen named Trent who beat Rita, the one who could wield fire like a dragon. Dirk nodded to him, a bit dazzled by his tough armor. Yes. That was a good fight. Very creative thinking. Most would have just thought to break through the walls. I sure wouldn't have thought to cook him alive. Thanks. Hmm. That head of yours will help a lot as you dungeon dive next year. And speaking of dungeons, there's one piece of advice I want to give you. The team got close to Dirk, speaking in a low voice. Sometimes, the people are worse than the monsters. Find people you trust, kid. And be wary of those you don't. Dirk went quiet, glancing at Trent weirdly. Trent only chuckled and backed away. He, don't let me scare you. I just speak from my experience. There's a lot of competition, and in the dungeons there are no rules. People will go to many lengths to get what they want. Thanks for the advice. Of course. It would be a shame to see a kid as talented as you die quickly. Now if you're sticking around, be sure to watch me kick this guy's ass. Trent pat Dirk's shoulder as another fight on the stage ended. He quickly jumped off his seat and headed for the arena, as did a kid who was a year older. Unfortunately, the fight didn't go as he expected. Trent was the one who got beat, but he sure didn't go down without a fight. His opponent was wounded and exhausted by the end, making him rather unhappy. Trent was all smiles though, even as he passed out with sparks flickering on his beat-up armor. After the battles ended, Dirk met up with his family and Ava. They all went to dinner, and Riker explained what was next for them. Even though Dirk won his battle, he wouldn't be fighting another. Today was the last day of the competition, and school would end in only a couple more days as well. In those couple days, each student would be reevaluated to determine if they were fit to continue. After that, those who were clear to continue would get a month of break before their next year started. Luckily, Dirk was already cleared for his next year. This was a perk of fighting in the competition. The referee and a select few staff members who watched the matches would use the fight as an evaluation. Naturally, those who placed well automatically advanced, especially the champion. There was no question that Dirk was eligible to re-enroll. Ava was the same as the third-place fighter. Because of that, their year was effectively over. They didn't even have anything to attend, so their break started now. However, to Ava's distress, this didn't cause Dirk to alter his schedule in any way. The last day of the competition passed, and the next morning came. Since Ava was still staying at Dirk's, she woke up and headed down only to find Dirk doing his morning martial meditation routine. Despite being a bit baffled, she didn't say anything or interrupt him. And since she enjoyed it as well, she went to join him. Their arms flowed as they moved their upper bodies. Their legs and hips moved with it, 
transferring their weight and maintaining perfect balance throughout all the movements. They bent low, raised their chests high, and trusted their arms and legs in familiar ways. Many of the movements were actual punches or kicks, only slowed down and controlled. The movements stretched and warmed their bodies, preparing their tendons and joints for whatever may come and putting their body in a harmonious state. And when it was all done, they settled their hearts and blood, opening their eyes with tranquil minds. So why are you working out during our break? Ava asked as they stood there, looking off into the distance at the other houses and green grass. Hearing the question, Dirk turned and looked at her with a raised eyebrow. She glanced at him and rolled her eyes. Never mind. Dumb question to ask. Working out during peaceful times is most optimal. There's no threat to your life and you don't have to worry about being caught while you're weak and recovering. It also prepares you for what's to come. We're going to be fighting monsters soon, so now above all is the time to be strengthening ourselves. HM, I guess. I still want to rest some though. Some rest is fine. Take the next few days off while you recover. You earned it. Thanks. But I think I'll rest later. Ava said as she smiled and walked into the house. When she came back out with some water bags, she spoke again. I got a message from my parents a little while ago. They want me to come home during break. It'll probably be a two or three week long visit. Really? Are you allowed to do that? Of course. The academy isn't a prison. Most of the students will be gone during break to visit parents, in fact. It's a special case for you since your parents are here, so you can see them anytime. There are a lot of students whose parents are in another city or town, so they have to travel to see them. H.M. When do you leave? Three days, when school officially ends. It's not like I'll be that far, though I don't think I'll be going in and out of here. My parents said that we have some things we need to do and talk about. Things like dungeon diving, weapons, armor, and other things. Hmm. You do need to figure out what kind of weapon you want to use. However, the most important thing you can do is ensure you can use a myriad of weapons. Anything can be a weapon in the right hands. Limiting yourself to a single weapon and style is a surefire way of getting caught off guard and killed, since when you don't have your weapon, you'll be rendered ineffective. I'll keep that in mind. As for armor, make sure you're able to move around in it. And make sure everything is covered. Your vitals need to be protected above all else. Vitals? Yes. These are your vitals. Dirk pointed at Ava's chest. Your torso from the middle of the abdomen upward, your neck, and your head. These three places should not be significantly harmed in any way during a fight, or you risk sustaining a lethal wound. Though, even lighter hits can be debilitating. Like hits to the liver. Activate your core. Hmm. Ava was a bit confused by the sudden command, but she didn't hesitate to clench her ABS. The next moment, Dirk threw a palm toward Ava's liver, just below her chest. When it landed, Ava was hit with a wave of pain and weakness despite being somewhat prepared. She fell to the floor. Ugh. There are spots that hurt much more than others, almost like a pressure point. They can disable or stun you and in a fight you naturally don't want to suffer from those effects. Tonight I'll run you through the points to protect. When you go get armor, you can work around those points. Now let's work out. Cough, alright. Ava nodded weakly as she forced herself up, taking deep breaths to flush the pain out of her body. She looked at Dirk's back as he walked to an open area, shaking her head a bit. Dirk taught by example, so when he taught her about combat, it was usually through demonstration. Such demonstrations involved taking hits followed by bouts of pain. She had gotten used to it though. Her pain tolerance was exceptionally high now. The day went by relaxedly with the two training both magic and body. After workouts, Dirk would change Ava's bandages and give her potions. The wounds got better by the day, so she soon wouldn't need the bandages at all. Like this, three days pass. School ended uneventfully, and Dirk saw dozens of kids leaving the academy every day. Most were leaving to visit parents, 
but there were some that would never return. Those people left with packed bags and tears running down their faces. On this day, Dirk walked with Ava to the gates. She had a single small bag over her shoulder. In that bag were some clothes and a few sheets of paper which Dirk had drawn up for her. Those sheets detailed things for armor and a few weapons. While Dirk wasn't very knowledgeable on this world's combat styles, weapons were weapons. He had the philosophy of using anything on hand, whether it was a sword, a bow, a knife, a rock, or dirt. He explained this to Ava, but it would ultimately be up to her what she wanted to do. The two walked to the gate where many carriages were waiting for various people. Ava was able to quickly find hers, but before going, she turned to Dirk. I guess I'll see you in a while. Hmm. Sheesh. It's like you don't even care. Come here. Rolling her eyes at his dull response, Ava walked over and wrapped her arms around Dirk. He sighed and responded, the two enjoying each other's embrace for a while. Hmm, all right. Goodbye, Dirk. Bye. With that, they separated, and Ava walked to her carriage. Dirk watched her drive off before turning around and walking back into the academy. His break had officially started. Chapter 38, Weapon Training A week passes uneventfully with Dirk going about his days. The entire time, he hardly even left his house other than to work out. He just kept to himself, and he was perfectly content with things that way. He woke up early and went to bed early, his routine being repeated day by day at exactly the same minutes each day. While his workouts and magic training were filled with pain, he was fine with it. It was a way to keep him occupied. He didn't just train though. When school had ended, Dirk had asked his father for books on dungeon monsters. He had been taught a lot about dungeons and monsters during his first year, but he wanted more precise information. Being knowledgeable about your enemies was crucial to success in battle. Luckily, his father agreed and gave him a catalog that documented tons of different monsters, from birds to lizards. Not long after he got it, Dirk documented the entire thing and slowly went through it to memorize the information. He found all kinds of monsters with various characteristics, attack patterns, strengths, and weaknesses. He studied and trained just like this for a week. At the end of that week though, Rita came to find him with a smile on her face. No more girlfriend, huh? Well, maybe this'll cheer you up. Come with me. Saying that, she led Dirk to their father's house. He just rolled his eyes and followed, quickly arriving at the nice house. Cecilia was also there, so Dirk gave her a nice big hug before they got down to business. Riker spoke. You're going to be dungeon diving next year, and a big part of dungeon diving is your weapons and armor. While you use that staff for the competition, that won't cut it in the dungeon. You need a real weapon, a blade. Your weapon will be your most important asset next to your armor. And today, you're going to choose one. Come. With that explanation, they all walked into another room. This room had a big table on it, and the table was covered entirely by weapons of all kinds. Dirk walked up to it and examined the weapons. I know you aren't familiar with anything, so I've planned for you to use your break to train with different weapons. We've got knives, spears, swords, bows, hammers, and axes. There are many variations of all these weapons, but I've only brought out the more basic ones. Now, go ahead and choose one that you think you like or multiple if you wish. Riker spoke as Dirk looked at everything. Everything on the table was real, and they all looked rather high quality as well. Dirk started thinking about the monsters he saw in the books and determined what he would want to use. With a bit of thought, his hands first hovered to the bow. He picked it up and plucked the string. It took a lot of force to bring back, much more than a normal bow. The wood felt harder and stronger as well, so this definitely wasn't a normal bow. After the bow, Dirk picked up a knife. There were a few sets of knives in different shapes and sizes. Dirk grabbed a big one and then two smaller ones, feeling each one. At first, his hands handled them like an expert, but after sensing his mother's gaze, he dulled himself before quickly putting them down. Then, Dirk picked up a spear. 
he felt the weight which wasn't very high and moved it around a bit. While he wasn't trained with a spear, he was able to quickly adapt. It was almost as if he understood the weapon naturally. His head simulated various scenarios in which he would use it against all kinds of monsters. After a bit, he put down the spear and moved on to the other weapons. He scanned through and grabbed a couple like the hammers and axes, handling them before setting them back down. Eventually, he came to a conclusion. If I were to go into the dungeon, I'd want four weapons. The bow, the spear, a few knives, and the hatchet. Dirk spoke simply. Among the weapons, these four would prepare him best for the most amount of monsters and scenarios. He could fight long, medium, and short range with these. And in close range, he could use a heavy or light weapon, enabling him to use different styles against different enemies. Some enemies had tough hides and some were fast. The knives and hatchet would cover his base as well. Riker, Cecilia, and Rita heard him and were surprised. Kids didn't normally pick out four weapons, especially when they didn't know anything about them. Moreover, it didn't seem like he was just taking the coolest weapons either. Cecilia was especially surprised. After looking at the weapons, she realized that those four would indeed cover every mode of attack, allowing for the greatest versatility. While one would have to train in all those weapons, it would make one much more reliable in any fight. But only someone who had experienced combat would be able to make this judgment, thus why Cecilia was surprised. She had been suspicious for a while of her son's ability and knowledge, and this situation didn't help that. Her face became conflicted as unknown thoughts ran through her head. She remained silent though, allowing Riker to handle things. Those are good choices, but let's start with one first. How about you start with the bow? It's safe and rather straightforward. Here. Riker grabbed the bow and handed it to Dirk. He also grabbed a quiver filled with arrows that was leaning on the table. After handing it to Dirk, he spoke. All right, since you have a weapon, we'll start your training. Your mother is going to be your teacher. She can actually use all of these, some better than others. She's going to give you the basics of the ones you chose. If we have time, we'll try to go through all of them to give you a taste of each. Yes, we should be able to work with all of them. And we can work for longer than a month if need be. Dungeon diving won't start right away anyway. Now come with me. Time to try out that new weapon. Cecilia spoke and brought Dirk outside. Riker let them be while Rita followed to watch. The three walked to the backyard that was surrounded by walls. There was another table out here as well as some test dummies. The table held targets, more arrows, and some logs. They had prepared everything for all the weapons to be used. Now, using a bow is both simple and complex. The basic mechanism is easy. You just take an arrow and knock it onto the string. You then pull back and release, sending the arrow flying. The hard part comes with all the little details. Things like your fingers, your grip, arrow positioning, angling your bow, and more. That will come gradually though. For now, let's make sure you can at least loose an arrow. Here, watch me. Cecilia spoke as she took the bow. Dirk watched her take an arrow and knock it, pulling the string back like it was nothing. Her form was solid as she aimed at one of the dummies, releasing the arrow. Fling! The arrow zipped through the air, landing on the dummy's head. The dummy was ten meters away, so while it wasn't difficult to hit in the slightest, it was still a decent display of accuracy. The bow wasn't even her primary weapon either. Dirk wondered about the extent of her training. There. Now you try. I'll help you as you do it. She handed the bow back to him. Dirk took it and mimicked her stance. He copied the grip, the angle, and the arrow position. He kept both eyes open as he aimed at the same dummy. After pulling it back as far as he could, he steadied himself before letting go. Fling! The arrow sailed a bit slower than Cecilia's. Dirk watched it land on the right side of the dummy's chest. After lowering the bow, he looked at the arrow with a blank face. Good! You pick things up surprisingly fast, don't you? Cecilia ruffled his hair excitedly. 
Meanwhile, Dirk thought to himself. Back on Earth, he had trained with the bow. He had trained with all kinds of weapons. Out of the four weapons he chose, he was only unfamiliar with the spear since that was never a realistic weapon to use on Earth. But everything else, especially the bow and knives, he was proficient with. While he wasn't an expert with the bow, he was far from a beginner. But he tried not to show it. Dirk just did what his mother did and then messed up a little. He aimed for the chest, but only hit near the shoulder. She was already suspicious enough, so he didn't need to worsen his situation. For the next several hours, Cecilia had Dirk constantly shooting arrows. She did various corrections on his form along the way, making it more perfect and his shots more precise. After that, since his aim was good, she activated a magic function on the target dummies, making them move. Dirk stood and attempted to shoot the moving targets. Obviously, his accuracy went down. This carried on until the end of the day. When the sun began to set, Cecilia concluded the day's training. They then had a nice dinner, after which Dirk headed home. The next day, Dirk was back at it again. He spent eight hours doing nothing but shooting arrows. He got better and better though. At least, that's what Cecilia saw. This went on for another day. On the fourth day, Cecilia finally had him practice with another weapon. They moved on to the spear, and this time Dirk didn't fake anything since he knew nothing about the spear. He listened to his mother's guidance as he quickly got used to the weapon. His thrusts became smooth and straight while his slashes became controlled. Dirk was quick to learn the basics, and it surprised Cecilia. Dirk trained with the spear for three days before moving on to the knives. After another three days, he moved on to the hatchet. These cycles would repeat until he finally went through almost all of the weapons. When the end of his training came, Cecilia concluded that Dirk could definitely use the bow, knives, and hatchet. And while he wasn't as skilled with the spear, she thought he should work on it more anyway. She also thought he should use a sword, but he couldn't take too many weapons with him at once. For was already pushing it, so he would need to drop the spear if he wanted to use the sword. That decision would come later though when he actually used the weapons and developed preferences. Until then, he just needed to practice more and wait for his first dungeon dive. During the time he was training, Cecilia also arranged some armor for him. While it wouldn't be the highest quality stuff, it would be plenty sufficient for what he would face. She just told him to trust her as she took some measurements and drew it up herself. While Dirk didn't enjoy not getting a say in his armor design, he trusted his mother, so he didn't worry too much. With that, Dirk waited as the first day for his next school year approached. Meanwhile, as Dirk trained at home, Ava was doing her own things with her parents. However, she wasn't having as nice of a time. Her first week was normal. After resting for a few days, she continued to work out on her own. Her wounds healed nicely as well, letting her get rid of the bandages. Her parents had been surprised to see the wounds, but she just brushed it off saying that she earned top three in her class in exchange. After that, her parents discussed dungeon diving with her. Hearing that Ava wanted to dungeon dive, they figured out what weapons and armor she would use. Like with Dirk, she was able to choose from a myriad of types. Seeing all the different weapons, Ava was a bit overwhelmed. However, she had gone over all the weapons with Dirk and talked about all that. With the knowledge he imparted, she had pondered on the weapon she would use for a while. Eventually, she decided on the one she would try out first. Since she was an anima trainer, Ava decided she would try out the axe. The axe she chose had a big curved blade on one end and a sharp pick end on the other. It wasn't excessively big or heavy, letting her wield it comfortably with one or two hands. As her secondary, she also chose some knives, just like Dirk did. She knew that it was always good to have backups, so while she may not use them as much as Dirk, she wanted to at least have them there. Her parents didn't argue as she made her choice. They didn't find any fault with it, so they arranged for a bit of training with the weapons. From there, Ava went on to train for a few hours each day on how to wield the axe and knives. Outside of that, Ava simply went on with her own routine. For a while, she found herself bored. 
However, one day, she stumbled upon something she would have rather never seen. While her father was out working, Ava went into his study to look at some of the books. She wasn't like Dirk who could train all hours of the day and wanted a bit of mental stimulation, so she sought out some academia. However, as she looked through the bookshelves, she found herself glimpsing at the papers on her father's desk. At first, she only wanted to take a little look at the kind of work her father did. She had never actually known what he did, only that he worked with people. But after reading a few words on one of the papers, her attention was caught. Weekly Shipment Statement Human Males, 27 Human Females, 33 Elven Males, 2 Elven Females, 5 Vampiric Males, 7 Vampiric Females, 7 Dwarven Males, 12 Dwarven Females, 18 Total Count, 111 Weekly Transaction Statement Human Males 21 sold. Human females, 44 sold. Elven males. Ava looked at the sheets of paper detailing different sets of business information. At first, she couldn't quite grasp what she was reading. But as she read more, she slowly came to understand. Slaves. My dad works with slaves. Ava was shocked at the conclusion she came to. She obviously knew what slaves were. The academy had talked about them briefly, and she heard even more from her friends. Slaves were people who were put under a special contract. Some contracts were lenient, but most were the kind that removed free will. They had to obey their masters or risk losing their lives. They could be put under excruciating pain should they disobey. It was a miserable life, to say the least. But in the Horizon Empire that was dominated by humans, slaves were illegal. That wasn't the case in all empires, but it was here. This was the reason why the Horizon Empire, despite being dominated by humans, was so popular with other races. However, Ava was learning that her father worked in an illegal industry. She read more and more of his papers that detailed things like money records and dealings with other bosses. Some papers detailed specific slaves and what type of slave they were. There were the normal ones like fighters craftsmen, and maids. But there were also those like sex slaves and death slaves, ones who would be used for things that practically guaranteed their demise. There were even letters from various households that expressed their desire for these slaves. The fact that she recognized one of the names shocked her. The more Ava read, the more she felt her heart drop. After almost an hour of snooping around, she finally couldn't take it anymore and put everything back the way it was before leaving the room. That night, when her father got home, she did her best to avoid him, feigning exhaustion and going to bed early. She knew that he would be able to see the turbulence of her mind. After all, she inherited the ability from him, so she didn't allow him to see her directly, locking herself away. Luckily, the next day Ava was calmed down. She acted perfectly normal, going about her day and training as she had been. However, she began to internally debate herself. She wondered what she should do. Should she stay quiet, pretending like she saw nothing? Or should she confront her father about it? Suddenly, she remembered Dirk's words, Be strong in all things you do. Ever since he spoke them, Ava had done her best to apply that logic to her daily life. Strength had become her creed in a way. But now, when faced with her father and his questionable deeds and morals, she found herself conflicted. Whenever she thought about what her father did every day and how he had been doing that for years without her knowing, she felt a bit scared. She wondered if she should be okay with it. Strength was the way of the world, so the slaves could only blame themselves for their positions, right? But she couldn't justify it. There was such a thing as morality and right and wrong, even in this world where the strongest ruled. It was why kingdoms and empires could stand. Those empires that crushed the weak never lasted long, because even the weak had a role to play. Ava eventually came to the conclusion that what her father did was wrong. Even that was a nice way of putting it. From the things she saw, it could be described as disgusting. Some slaves were made that way due to debt or crimes, but many were simply kidnapped and turned into merchandise. 
and her father was the boss, the one who orchestrated and enabled these heinous acts with his money. The amount of lives that were ruined and tossed into misery because of him. Ava became disgusted, repulsed even. But she couldn't bring herself to do anything. Day by day passed, and each night she found herself ridden with guilt. She hated herself for not being able to stand up and at least talk to her father. She got close a few times, but she would be overwhelmed by anxiety each time. In the end, the month of break passed with her having done nothing. She had to use her weapon training and workouts to get her mind off of the guilt she felt. And finally, when school started up again, she boarded her carriage. The drive to the academy felt all the more depressing. She felt the weight of all those ruined lives on her shoulders. Chapter 39, First Kill Well, I think we know what you're good at now. I guess you have your gear then. Cecilia spoke as she looked at Dirk. He was practicing with the hatchet, and he showed talent with it. Cecilia had been shocked at how capable he was with all the weapons he used. It was like he naturally knew how to use everything, and even the things he was unfamiliar with he could pick up rather quickly. In the end though, Dirk showed preference to the four weapons he chose, and Cecilia didn't oppose him. With his weapons determined, she put them in his possession. Dirk received two short knives, one long knife, one combat hatchet, a spear, and a bow with some arrows. Dirk also eventually received the armor that his mother was entrusted to design. One day while Dirk was training in his house, Cecilia barged in unannounced. Dirk went to meet her and saw her place a case on his table. All right, come take a look. I had a friend of mine make it himself for you. It isn't anything crazy, but it will be more than enough for what you're facing. I guarantee it's protection from anything below a tier 5. Of course, everything depends on the situation, but you're not stupid enough to be totally reliant on your armor. Anyway, open it up. Cecilia explained before pointing Dirk toward the case. He walked over to it silently before popping it open and grabbing the garments inside. The first thing he grabbed was the torso armor. A black leather long sleeve shirt with dark gray metal plating around all vital areas including the chest, sides, stomach, and even a spine guard the length of the shirt. Dirk was surprised at how well thought out the plate placement was. He then realized how knowledgeable his mother was about such things. Next were the pants. Those were the same black leather and gray metal. There were metal coverings around the knee, butt, hips, thighs, shins, and the back of the calves. All the leather was fitted as well, so it was only a bit bigger than his size. His mother explained to him that he would be growing quickly, so this would give him a little more room and make the armor last longer. Next was the boots, helmet, and gloves. The gloves had finger and knuckle plating, while the boots were surprisingly similar to combat boots from Earth with plating in the toe, heel, and sole. As for the helmet, it was shaped like a hood with thicker than normal leather on it. There was even a mask that could cover his face. The armor also had many different straps and holders for various things like weapons and items. There were a few knife sheaths for the knives and hatchet Dirk received as well as a holder for his spear. This would make sure all his weapons could be secured to his body and equipped quickly. Then there were some pouches for miscellaneous items and whatever he would want to keep on his person. Cecilia had Dirk try everything on. When he had it all equipped, he looked just like an assassin. The thought made him feel weird. Was this on purpose, or did his mother just really like dark clothing? Though if it were up to Dirk, he would have chosen dark colors too. Anything dark was simply advantageous to be in. Being completely honest, his mother surpassed his expectations with the armor. It was comfortable, surprisingly light, tough, and his movements weren't limited. The leather, despite not being thick, was very impact and slash resistant. However, as his mother explained, he shouldn't be letting himself get into bad situations where his armor would need to save his life. Overall, the armor was fantastic. Dirk was thrilled to have it since it would increase his odds against any enemy. So? Cecilia asked with a smile seeing Dirk jump and move around in the armor. He nodded back to her. It's great. Thank you, mother. Of course. 
I can't let you go into the dungeons unprepared. This is a time of mistakes and learning. You must experience as much as possible while you face weak enemies so you make fewer mistakes when you face strong ones in the future. This armor will ensure that any mistakes you do make can be protected against. She walked over to him and adjusted the armor as she spoke. After, she kissed his forehead with a loving smile. I want you to stay safe in the dungeons. They are a place of great opportunity but also great danger. You're a smart boy, so I want you to keep yourself safe. And if you ever have any questions or problems, just come to me. Understood. Good. Not long after Dirk got his armor, his mother left him alone. He took off the armor and placed it back into its container for later use. After that, Dirk got to do whatever he wanted before school officially started. He was all set and ready for the dungeons. On the day before school started though, Ava came back. When she showed up at Dirk's door, he was a bit surprised. She seemed a lot gloomier than before. What's wrong? This was the first thing Dirk asked. Hearing the question, Ava's face dropped a bit. She took a while before responding. I saw, something not so good. But I don't want you to worry about it. All right. Dirk answered simply before bringing Ava into the house. She was surprised as he acted so nonchalant. You really won't ask about it? She asked hesitantly. Dirk turned to her with a raised eyebrow. Do you want me to? And no. Then I won't. But you shouldn't worry about things unnecessarily either. You look stressed right now, and that may hinder your performance in the dungeons and in school. You either need to stop worrying about whatever it is, or figure out a way to solve the problem. If you need help, do ask. Ava went quiet at his words, eventually just nodding. It was a bit heartless and lacking any compassion, but that's just how Dirk was. And that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Ava had a more emotional veil, and Dirk was the perfect counter to that. He kept things straightforward, which was sometimes how it needed to be. That day, Ava went back to exercising with Dirk. He easily noticed how her stamina went down since she was heaving for breath by the end. Whatever was on her mind, it really took its toll. Be sure to get your books, and here's your class list. Since you wanted to try forging and enchanting, I've put you in both classes. You're also in your elemental classes plus the anima training class. Needless to say, you're taking a full load, but I'm sure you can handle it. If the forging or enchanting classes prove to be too much, then let me know and you can be dropped. Riker explained Dirk's schedule to him. Currently, Dirk and Ava were eating breakfast together, something that surprised Riker a bit. He disregarded it though and talked about what he came for. Today was the first day of school. Since it was Dirk's second year, not only would he be dungeon diving, but he could also practice forging and enchanting. Over the month break, Dirk had expressed his desire to try it, so his father enrolled him. This would add two more classes, but with Dirk's diligence, he could get through it so long as he was willing to invest a few more hours each day. Not only that, Riker helped Ava with enrolling in alchemy. Since she had the water attribute, she was cut out for it, so she decided to give it a shot. And since she only had one element class and the anima training class, she had plenty of time to spare. With their new schedules, Dirk and Ava started their first day. Dirk went to his first class which was the Earth Element class. Upon arriving though and picking a seat, the teacher made an announcement to the class. Today is your first day, but there won't be as much of an adaptation period. This announcement is being made to all of you second years, you will have your first kill initiation in one week. On that day, you will take the life of a monster with any weapon or magic of your choosing. A few weeks after that, you will have your first dungeon dive. The dungeon dives are optional, but the first kill is not, and there will be consequences should you fail to make the first kill. More details will be given to you when the day comes. Now, let's start class. After completing his announcement, the teacher turned and opened up his book. Meanwhile, much of the class was shocked by such a bombshell of an announcement. Only some, like Dirk, already knew what this first kill initiation was. 
Upon entering their second year, every kid would be placed in the arena with a monster which they would have to take the life of. Some students in the past had failed to kill their monster out of fear or incompetence. Those that cowered were usually expelled from the school on the spot, and those that at least put up a fight were forced to do combat training before making their first kill later. In Rita's words, it was the school's way of getting rid of the exceptionally weak-willed. Anybody who wanted to become a capable mage or warrior needed to be capable of fighting and killing. While Dirk had thought that it was a rather excessive initiation, this was a different world that worked on a different set of laws. Here, killing monsters was commonplace. For what the academy was preparing these kids for, maybe a first kill initiation wasn't so bad. At least it wasn't an actual person. After the announcement, the teacher went on with the class as normal. Dirk was given a new book and introduced to several new concepts that he would be learning about through the year. The book had many new spell theories that were more advanced than the ones he had learned the year before. It would be like this for every class throughout the day. Even the anima class was more advanced. Like last year, Ava and Dirk were put in the same group. The instructor was even stricter than the last, and the first day only ended after every kid besides Dirk and Ava threw up. In this class, they would be taught more combat techniques and even an anima techniques. That second part was only for those that needed it though. Unlike Dirk, not all kids had built-in skills that came with their manual. This was the unfortunate consequence of receiving low-grade manuals and techniques. Finally, there were the forging and enchanting classes. The forging class was first, and here Dirk was put under the tutelage of a dwarf with no hair or beard. The dwarf had a face that seemed to be eternally covered in ashen soot, and he spoke while coughing. Okay. Listen up. Cough. I'll be your teacher for the year, and possibly the year after. Who the hell knows? Anyway, you all are, the second year class. Yeah, you'll be learning the basic techniques. Shit like starting a furnace without blowing yourself up and how not to touch hot metal. You'd think it'd be common sense, but no, kids get burned every single year. Cough. Anyway. Just listen to the shit I say and hopefully some of you will show some level of skill. Now pick up your damned books and flip to the first no, tenth page. Cough. The dwarf didn't mess around before getting straight into things. Dirk picked up his book which had some burned pages and flipped to the tenth page. When he did, he could see a hole in the middle of the page caused by fire. I can't scan a book that's been burned to nothing. He sighed inwardly before just listening along. He could also see the book of another student, though others were burned too. Luckily, after looking at enough, his AI was able to piece things together to form a full page. They were introduced to several concepts that class, things like forging techniques, types of metal, types of fire, and the tools they would be using. Dirk scanned all the pages of his book, but since there were burned holes everywhere, he had to go to look at other students' books at the end of class to fill in the pages. Ultimately, by the end of class he was only able to piece together the first few parts of the book. That was enough though, and when class let out, Dirk moved on to the enchanting class. Upon entering this class, Dirk was surprised. There were only six students including him. Four boys and two girls, and all of the students were at least a year older than him. Dirk wondered why there were so little students for a bit before the teacher walked in and started class. The teacher was an older man, and even Dirk could sense a deep intellect from him. The man scanned around the students, pausing on Dirk for a bit before speaking. Welcome to enchanting class. I'm Master Hans. This year, I'm going to teach the fundamentals of enchanting. I will also evaluate you all throughout the year to see if you have the ability to enchant. If you show no ability, you will be dropped. Now, allow me to explain what enchanting is. Saying that, Master Hans picked up a leather sack and stuck his hand inside of it. He then pulled out a long sword that was obviously bigger than the sack itself. Dirk's eyes bulged a bit seeing that impossible display. Enchanting is the process of imbuing magical functions onto items. Many items have inherent magic properties like an affinity to the elements or mystical effects on various objects. 
However, enchanting is the intentional practice of imparting a mystical effect. Take this bag, for example. This used to be an ordinary piece of leather from a tier 5 monster. But after going through the hands of a dark enchanter, it became a spatial storage bag capable of containing many times its own size. With the right skill, intellect, and ingredients, there is nothing an enchanter cannot make. Many enchanters are also craftsmen of some kind, whether it be an alchemist or a blacksmith. Being a decent craftsman is almost a prerequisite to even attempting enchanting. However, there is just as much theory in mathematics and enchanting as there is crafting, so this takes both brains and brawn. The books I'm about to give you are exceptionally valuable. Only in places like this academy will you find such a book. Because of this, this book will never leave this room nor the academy. If you wish to take home information to study, you will need to write notes yourself. However, this room will also be open to you at all times during the day, so you can spend more time here with the book. Now, take your book and open to the first page. Master Hans went on for a bit before handing everyone a book. Unlike the ones in the forging class, these were absolutely pristine. The covers had metal on them and the pages were made of parchment. The book was like a work of art itself. Dirk was quick to begin flipping through pages, scanning all information he looked at. Master Hans glanced at him before continuing with class. By the end of class, Dirk had scanned the entire book, and Master Hans went through his introduction. This class would be filled with drawing, mathematics, theory of mana and magic, and applied practice. Dirk could tell how difficult the class would be as even he had a hard time understanding what any of the concepts within the book meant. Soon, the end of class came. Dirk immediately stood up when the bell rang, but he was the only one. The other five students glanced at him before burying their noses back into their books. Dirk felt a bit weird for a second before shrugging and leaving. Upon arriving back at his house, Dirk saw that Ava was down in the magic basement training her mana technique. He decided to join her, and the two spent a couple hours within the dense mana. Dirk's week was rather uneventful as the day of the first kill initiation approached. However, he was about the only one who wasn't nervous in some way. Even Ava couldn't get her mind off of it, and she repeatedly discussed it with Dirk. She talked all about what kind of monster they may fight and how she would go about killing it. Dirk was mostly silent while she rambled on, only giving input occasionally. Then, the day came. All of Dirk's classmates were nervous as they were all called to the arena. Dirk walked there with Ava and was surprised to see teachers and staff sitting in the stands. There were even a bunch of students, all waiting around as if they were about to watch a show. Prior to coming to the arena, all students had prepared armor and weapons. The ones who only used magic were donned in various pieces of metal covering while carrying shields. Those who fought with melee weapons had their preferred weapon as well as their own armor. It looked like a child army was gathering as all the kids piled into the arena space. Even Ava stood next to Dirk wearing rather decent armor. The armor fit almost all the specifications that Dirk had told her about. Not only that, but it looked just as nice as Dirk's. He was a bit surprised seeing that since Ava's parents were a lower class, thus they probably wouldn't be able to spend as much but it looked like they decided to splurge for their daughter. He was also surprised to see the war axe in Ava's hand. It definitely wasn't a bad weapon should it be used properly. Unlike the rest of the students that he was looking at though, Dirk wasn't dressed in any armor. He wore the same plain clothes that he did while fighting in the competition. The only piece of gear he had on him was his large knife that he carried while sheathed. The fact that he came with no armor greatly distressed Ava, in fact. The entire time that they were at the house prior, she had been practically begging him to put it on. They would be fighting a monster, after all. However, he just shook his head and grabbed only one of his many weapons. He gave a single reason as to why he didn't put on the armor, because it would get dirty. Ava was baffled, but she didn't have the ability to force Dirk to listen to her. Thus, she could only walk with him to the arena, glancing at him with worry. After all the kids were gathered in the arena, the principal, Duke Hillshire, stepped up on the stage and overlooked everyone with a solemn gaze. Chapter 40, Backbone 
Welcome, second years. Today, you are all here for your first kill initiation. This will mark the beginning of your life as a magician or warrior. Should you pass, you will be allowed to dungeon dive and continue attending the academy. Should you fail, you may be expelled. Now, I'm not going to give a lengthy speech. The only thing I want to let you all know about is the fact that none of you will be under any life-threatening danger. While the monsters here today are capable of injuring and even killing you, we will not allow them to kill. Your goal is to kill them instead. Do so, and you pass. Now, take a look at what you will be facing. The Duke spoke to all the kids, afterward motioning over to one of the other stages. A magic barrier was lifted in that instant, and everyone could see something new. Line after line of chained up monsters. These monsters were short and humanoid. Their limbs were skinny, their skin a pale tan, their teeth abnormally sharp, and their heads large. These were goblins. Goblins were one of the most primitive species, but they are capable of evolving into much more fearsome creatures. They were considered the primitive ancestors of the intelligent dwarves, and their evolutions include the fearsome ogres. Despite being the most primitive, however, they were by no means weak. Hillshire continued to explain after all the kids looked at their opponents. These are goblins. I'm sure you all know what a goblin is. The ones we've picked out for you all are all at the peak of rank 1. They are about as strong as an ordinary adult man. Because of this, they are plenty capable of doing damage. You will need your magic or your anima in order to kill them. Should you only use your bodily strength, you may not get far. Now, it's time to start your initiations. The first ones to go will be those who competed in the tournament, and the first to start off among those will be your champion, Dirk Strider. The Duke said the first name, and everyone heaved a sigh of relief. They then looked around, all eyes eventually falling on the armorless Dirk. I can't tell if that's unlucky or not. Dirk sighed inwardly. Ava looked at him worriedly for a second before he walked over. The kids all opened up a path, and he walked up to the arena. Bring the first one over. The Duke spoke, and one of the staff members unchained a goblin. They restrained it easily as they walked it over and paced it into the arena with Dirk. The goblin growled and struggled the entire time, showing off its ferocity. The Duke walked over to stand next to Dirk. Now Dirk, since you are the champion, we've picked out a special one for you. This one is rank 2, so it's stronger than the others. As the champion of your class, you will be expected to perform better. Your display in the tournament fights show that you should be capable of fighting a goblin of this level. Also, the Duke's voice became lower as he bent down to whisper in Dirk's ear. This is a request from your parents. Make them proud. With that, the Duke stood back up. Dirk had a weird expression on his face as he did so. Now Dirk, are you ready? Hillshire backed up, standing in the corner of the arena away from the goblin and Dirk. Dirk simply nodded, unsheathing his knife. Good. Release the goblin. With that, the goblin was unchained. It went berserk for a bit, slashing at the staff before turning and laying eyes on Dirk. It growled and stared at him with its odd eyes. Dirk stared back, an odd feeling welling up within him. Draw blood. Dirk's heart rate slowed, and it was as if something was whispering in his ear. He concentrated on the goblin as it inched closer to him. He didn't move. Kill it. Another whisper, and the goblin suddenly dashed toward Dirk. He simply stood in place as it rushed him. He could tell, the goblin wanted nothing more than to tear his throat out and eat his guts. Its primal instinct for killing was unmatched. The goblin rapidly approached, and soon, it was only a few feet away. Dirk looked straight into its eyes as something seemed to explode out of him. And its filthy life. Shing! Like a bullet, Dirk's arm shot up. The goblin's movement stopped, its face right in front of his. Every single one of Dirk's classmates were holding their breaths. Drip. Dirk looked down. His hand was right under the goblin's chin, and the blade of the knife in its skull. The top of the knife protruded out of the top of the goblin's head. 
Its body was also suspended above the floor as Dirk lifted it up with the knife. As if snapping out of a dream, Dirk returned to reality. He felt his heart, which was beating at a surprisingly slow rate, and then he realized that anima was being consumed to strengthen him. Stopping his activation of anima and relaxing his body, he looked at all the blood dripping down his hand and onto his arm. He lowered the goblin and grabbed its head with his free hand, pulling it off the knife and tossing the body aside like a rag doll. Grabbing a cloth from his pocket, Dirk wiped the knife of all blood. When it was all clean, he returned it to its sheath, looking over to the duke with a blank gaze. The duke returned the look, his eyes gleaming as if he were pondering something. Dirk's parents, who were also secretly in the stands, had several thoughts cross their minds as well. Good job, Dirk. The champion doesn't disappoint. You can either stay here or go home to clean up. Understood. With a nod, Dirk stepped off the stage. Some staff members came and cleaned up the goblin body before the next student was called up. It was the second-place kid who lost to Dirk, Alec. Alec stepped up to the stage, glancing at Dirk before concentrating on the next goblin. This one was weaker than Dirk's, but he didn't seem to care. He unsheathed his sword as the goblin was released, and with a single stroke, the goblin was beheaded. He then sheathed the sword and walked down, not sparing anyone a glance as he exited the stadium. Next, it was Ava's turn. She turned to Dirk who had returned to her side. He just nodded to her, and she went up. She stood face to face with her goblin. She lifted her war axe, and the goblin was released. She thought about Dirk's and Alec's previous kills and sought to do the same. One stroke. She thought to herself as she prepared. And when the goblin got close, she lifted and brought down her axe. The blade came right down on the goblin's skull, smashing it to nothing. It then continued to the body, crashing through it uninhibited. After the axe slammed into the floor, Ava stopped and picked her axe back up. She looked at the body that was reduced to gore in front of her, and her stomach contracted. She lifted her hand to her mouth, her body overwhelmed by weakness. She used her axe to prop herself up as she barely held back from throwing up. She eventually turned away, taking time to settle herself. She thought of how Dirk didn't even flinch and how she shouldn't either. She yelled at herself in her mind, forcing herself to stand straight and walk off the stage. She didn't even respond as the Duke congratulated her, too concentrated on keeping her stomach in check. When she got back to Dirk, she pushed him toward the exit. He followed along as they left, heading back to the house. As the two walked out, a man in the stands raised his head and eyed them, his mouth ever so slightly curving into a smile. Cough! Upon walking through the door to the house, Ava rushed to the kitchen sink and heaved a few times. Dirk walked to her side in case she threw up, holding her hair. She didn't though. After almost ten minutes, she seemed to calm down. Dirk could see it in her eyes though. The only thing she could think of was that gory mess she made. How, do you stay so calm? She asked after a while. Dirk glanced at her. It's only a monster and has no real life. I wouldn't think any more of it than I do the animals I eat every day for dinner, if not less. You'll get used to it with time and experience. I guess. Ava nodded and sighed. Meanwhile, Dirk pondered when he had first taken a life. In his other life, he had been trained to be numb to killing. It was ensured that it wouldn't affect him in any way, as only then could he kill with maximum efficiency. His first kill, he had thrown up himself. However, that was after killing an actual person. Still, he did indeed become numb to such things rather quickly. It became totally normal, just as normal as shooting a gun or eating food. Dirk couldn't even imagine being phased by the death of a human anymore, let alone a mindless monster like a goblin. To him, a goblin was lower than even animals that could provide something to him. Coming to this point though, Dirk thought back to when he killed the goblin, and he frowned. He had been overcome by this sense of bloodlust and reduced to instinct. He could barely remember when the goblin was running toward him. He hadn't fallen to such tunnel vision in many, many years, and the fact that he did now concerned him. Something about me is different. There's something in me that pushes me to fight, 
like in the tournament. It clouds my rationale. I'm just glad I still used the weapon this time. Dirk pondered his situation. He had noticed how his desire to fight surged when in such positions as with the goblin. When face to face with an enemy, his blood surged. For him, this wasn't normal. He was always totally aware of everything around him and calm as a rock. This was how he could keep himself alive through the most precarious situations. But there was now something that was clouding that. Something in him was affecting him, but he didn't know what. What about you, Interface? Did you hear those whispers? Negative. During their engagement, there was no abnormal audio. Hmm. He rubbed his chin. After a while though, he just gave up. He would try to pinpoint it next time. After Ava settled down, the two moved to the couch and stayed there in silence. During this silence, Dirk pondered for a while before giving a command. Generate model. Building host model. With a word, Dirk decided to check his body. Host model. Host age, 13 years. Blood type. Mana compatible blood. Skeletal structure, organic iron composite. Muscle structure, high power compacted fibers. Sensory organs, high sensitivity organic receptors. Self replicating nanorobotic maintenance and repair systems, online. Final stand weapon system, 92%, building. Overdrive systems, online. Current bodily state, combat capable, 100% healthy. Intelligence systems fully functional. Awaiting host orders. Dirk looked at the model and nodded. Not long after Dirk had his little incident where all his blood was purged from his body, the AI scanned and analyzed the new blood. However, the type it was changed to wasn't any of the normal types. Because of that, it couldn't name it. However, because it knew that the blood was compatible with mana, it just decided to call it as such. Other than that, the thing Dirk was most excited about was his final stand weapon system. Over the years, it had slowly attained minerals from Dirk and was able to build most of itself. It only needed a bit more now and estimated another few months until completion. Dirk could already feel the weapon in his abdomen. Technically, he could actually use it should he really need it. It would just be deployed with reduced performance, and this meant fewer bullets and a weaker structure. But he had no need for it right now. All he needed to do was wait. Profile With another thought, Dirk checked his magic profile. Profile Name, Dirk Strider Species, Human Tier, 2 plus. Rank, 3 plus. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7. Dirk looked over the stats. Until now. He had been working non-stop to cultivate his mana heart and carry out destruction cycles on his blood. However, as he got closer to completing both, they slowed down. His mana heart felt like it was on the verge of breaking through, but it had yet to cross a certain threshold. He didn't yet get the feelings that his book described, so he just stayed patient and continued. At the same time, he also researched the rune that his technique wanted him to implant onto the heart the one that would match the contraction of the mana heart to the beating of his actual heart. Surprisingly though, he was able to find similarities between the rune of the mana heart and enchanting. After today, he was thinking that learning enchanting would help him with his mana heart. As for his blood, that was just a matter of time. He couldn't tell how much blood was enhanced after every cycle, so he could only do the same thing over and over again. However, he didn't think it would take too much longer. He figured that he could advance to rank 4 after he reached tier 3. With that, Dirk was now familiar with his general position. And with the first kill initiation out of the way, he could move on to preparing for his first dungeon dive which would be at the end of the month. For the rest of the day, Dirk and Ava rested at the house. And because Ava was traumatized a bit, Dirk decided that they could take a day off. 
the two rested inside the magic workshop, calming their minds with the dense mana within. The day after the first kill initiation, all the second-year students went back to their classes. However, they were all a bit gloomier than before. The teachers saw this but didn't care. Thankfully, being in the presence of friends helped lighten everyone's mood. Dirk went through his classes all the same. The only thing that changed were the looks he got. All the kids would glance and stare at him, the image of him so easily and casually killing the goblin fresh in their minds. They all had their own assumptions, and now, they looked at him with an odd sense of fear. There was the feeling that he was simply superior to them. He was the champion and unfazed in all things he did. They couldn't understand him. But there was also a bit of respect. Everyone had been nervous and anxious prior to the first kill. But seeing him killing the goblin calmly gave them a sense of confidence. That day, he became something of a backbone for the rest of the class. He was the champion, and they followed in his footsteps. That didn't mean he was easier to talk to though. Dirk continued to be antisocial, just keeping to himself. At least, that was until he was approached by one of his classmates. Dirk! How have you been? After walking into his fire element class, Dirk heard his name be called out. He looked over and saw Alec, the second-place fighter of the tournament. Confused as to why he was being so familiar with him, Dirk looked at him weirdly. Come on, don't give me that look. I'm Alec, remember? You beat me for the championship. I remember. You wield the fire and light attributes and can train anima. Your skill with a sword is decent. And you're pretty good with a staff. Mind if I sit next to you? All right. Dirk nodded and Alec took the seat next to him that had been open anyway. Dirk had noticed that Alec was in this class prior, but after the first kill initiation, Alec apparently felt like talking to him. Alec spoke. You killed that goblin pretty easily. Are you ready for dungeon diving? Yes. You sound pretty confident. Are you nervous? No. Now what's up with you and that Ava girl? You two seem pretty close. She's my friend. Well that's obvious. Are you guys a couple? No. Wow. That was a quick answer. I have no reason to hesitate. H.M. Alec hummed at Dirk whose gaze remained forward. He smiled wryly. I can understand why people don't often talk to you. Not one for people, huh? Dirk stayed quiet, unsure of how to respond. He never had much of a social life, so he definitely wasn't a people person. His friend group consisted of a single person, after all. Alec took his silence as the answer. Well, let's have a good year together. Maybe we can help each other with fire magic. We dual attribute mages gotta stick together. How about it? Alec stuck out his hand, and Dirk looked over. Alec assumed he was only a dual attribute mage but he felt no reason to correct him. He shook his hand. With that introduction, the two started cooperating during class. While Dirk didn't understand why Alec felt the need to be familiar with him, he didn't actively push him away. The class was spent learning the beginnings of a new spell, and Dirk and Alec would discuss the working of the spell a bit. They explained their understandings of the spell and helped each other analyze why spells would do what they did. Soon, class ended, leaving Dirk a bit surprised. Alec was very knowledgeable about the fire element and he was able to help Dirk figure some things out. He could explain his thoughts well, making him easy to understand. Dirk found that he was a bit more mature than he looked. After class let out, Dirk went on to his last element class. His face wasn't so happy though. This was because at the beginning of the year, he had gotten a rude surprise. Dirk is here. How are you, my prodigious champion? I heard you easily killed the goblin. As expected from my favorite, most accomplished student. Chapter 41, Preparing Garol was there to greet Dirk right as he walked into class. Greetings like this occurred almost every day, and it embarrassed him a bit every time. Dirk had thought that Garol was the first-year teacher, thus he was happy come graduation day since he assumed he would get a new teacher. Not because Garol was bad, 
but because Dirk wanted a change of pace. However, the school had other plans, apparently. Dirk was stuck with this volatile teacher for another year. He made a note to never come into this classroom with any wound showing, otherwise he may risk getting force-fed another weird potion. He also carried his knife on him just in case. Dirk always lamented the fact that if Geralt were just a little dialed down, he would be infinitely more bearable. Unfortunately, in exchange for the quality teaching, Dirk would have to sacrifice a bit of his sanity. Geralt, with his one arm, began his teaching with unbridled enthusiasm. Dirk's brain went on autopilot for the first bit of class in order to get past all the questionable stories and intrusive questions for the students. When he finally got to teaching though, Dirk snapped back into it, listening intently. Dirk's first year, Geralt hadn't taught any dark spells. He only taught how to manipulate the dark element and had everyone hone their control over it. By the end of the year, everyone was able to form odd shapes and diagrams with strings of dark mana. While it sounded easy to do, Dirk found it surprisingly difficult. This was because the dark element never seemed to want to listen to him. It took great willpower in order to get it under control. In fact, this method of controlling the dark element was against Geralt's teachings. He always talked about how one had to flow with the dark element, both person and mana sinking together to guide each other in the same direction. To help with this, Geralt actually had the class do meditation sessions in an attempt to harmonize with the dark element. Unfortunately, even though Dirk tried to do it his way, he just couldn't. It felt wrong whenever he felt himself letting go and harmonizing with the element. He hated the feeling of losing control. So, he had to resort to the only way he knew. Using sheer willpower, Dirk forcefully bent the element to his will. When forming shapes with strings of the element, it was like bending a steel pole. The element didn't want to listen, but it had no choice under Dirk's domination. Geralt didn't exactly like this, saying it was the wrong way to use the element. And Dirk had to admit, when he saw other kids easily playing with the element, he got a bit doubtful. But he didn't know what other way to go about controlling it. So, he decided he would just take it as far as he could. Geralt could only let him do as he wished. For some reason, Geralt didn't argue much with Dirk. With the other kids though, he had no trouble scolding and correcting them. Thus summarized Dirk's Dark Element class. Thankfully, he at least never fell behind and could follow along fine. After that class, Dirk left and went to his next one. After walking to another area of the academy, he could hear shouts and hollers. His blank gaze rested on the Hall of Artisans, the home of the academy's production sector. This was where nearly all crafting was done and where Dirk's classes were. He walked into the hall and maneuvered through running persons to make his way to a room. He quickly opened the door and stepped in, closing the door behind him. All the outside noises were silenced. The room he was in now was rather large. The dwarven teacher sat on a chair at the front of the class while a few dozen other students stood around their desks. These weren't normal desks though. They were all anvils with little metal tables next to them. Each student had their own spot. All right. Listen up. Not long after he walked in, the dwarf started class. Dirk opened up his book to the instructed page, but didn't bother looking at it. Over the last week, he was able to look at other books and document the full pages. He could now view it any time he wanted in his head. The things Dirk learned about varied. There were many aspects to forging an item. Every single piece of equipment or material had things to learn about. Each student was being educated on all the parts of forging from the ore to the sharpening of a weapon. They had to know what all these things were if they wanted to do it themselves. This fact disappointed all the kids who thought that it was a brainless job consisting of nothing but slamming a hammer. But Dirk actually enjoyed it. There was a systematic way to go about forging, and he was able to pick up on everything easily. The dwarven teacher always nodded when Dirk answered something correctly, pleased that one of his students was smart. Finally, after the forging class was the enchanting class. Dirk went to another room in the Hall of Artisans, making sure he didn't run into anybody on the way. Upon arriving, he saw the same five people who merely glanced at him. 
they seemed very serious about this class, making him wonder why. And when class ended, all of them always stayed behind, making Dirk feel a tiny bit awkward when he immediately left alone. He pretty much understood everything though, so he didn't think much about it. Dirk's classes went from early in the morning to late in the evening, taking up basically all of his day. Even when he got home from class though, he was quick to begin training. Luckily, his physical training went from an average of three or four hours to only half an hour. When Dirk activated all the anima in his body and did exercises, it rapidly drained his energy, making for a quick and effective workout. Then, he would move on to training his man heart. This routine went on for a while. Ava quickly got over her little trauma and they both continued to train martial arts with Ava rapidly advancing in skill. They also started practicing with their weapons. Dirk would take time to use his bow while Ava swung her axe around at trees, cutting some down in the process. This went on until the end of the month where the second years were finally given the announcement they were waiting for. Tomorrow, those who have been signed up for it will be taken to do their first dungeon dive. The details are on this paper. You'll report to the arena in the morning in all of your gear, and all of you will be taken to the nearby dungeon. Things like food, water, and other supplies will be provided, and you'll be briefed on how to prepare for a dive in the future. The teacher in Dirk's first class explained to them. The date of the dungeon dive had been told to them a while ago, and this was the final announcement for it. All the students who had signed up, which were most of them, were excited. Dirk was also expectant. The dungeons were the next most mysterious thing about this world next to magic. Things like hostile monsters that could use magic themselves were interesting, and Dirk wondered how he would fare against them. For the rest of the day, all the second-year students were excited. For the first time in a few weeks, they weren't so gloomy or traumatized over their first kill. They were actually glad, and they looked back to the kill and wondered if they could do the same to these other monsters. All talk that day was about how strong the monsters were and how each person would match up. Plus, everyone had their armor and weapons, so they were all fantasizing about being valiant knights or mages and striking monsters down. However, although Dirk was expectant, he was also wondering what he would do about schooling while dungeon diving. According to his sister, dungeon dives could last weeks, even months. He didn't know the details as to why, but he knew he would be doing the same. He wondered how he was supposed to handle school and continue learning spells and magic theory. Unfortunately, nobody explained it to him, so he would have to just wait and see. Dirk went through the rest of his day, and upon returning home, Ava excitedly greeted him. Are you ready for dungeon diving? I heard we're going to the lesser dungeon next to the city. There are plenty of weak monsters there similar to the goblins. Nothing we can't handle. Oh, your gear is prepped, right? I brought mine over just in case. Ava bounced around as she chattered nonstop. Dirk thought over what she said. His first year, Dirk had learned quite a bit about dungeons. Dungeons existed around the entire world, and they came in three types. First, there were the six elemental dungeons. These six dungeons were the most powerful in the world, and there was an empire that resided over each of them. The reason these six dungeons were significant was because there was a great dragon that resided in each one. Each of these six great dragons was supremely powerful not unlike the emperors of each empire, and each held dominion over one of the elements. Six Dungeons, Six Elements The Horizon Empire resided over the Dungeon of Fire. However, there weren't only six dungeons. Around each of the six dungeons were major dungeons. These were less powerful than the six and more plentiful, but kids like Dirk would be easily slaughtered inside one. Then, there were minor dungeons. These were the most plentiful and the least powerful, and there was one just outside of the capital city that all the second-year academy students would be going to. While there were fluctuations of power among the monsters in each dungeon, that could be studied and prepared against. Each dungeon was its own separate space, so unless one had been observed and documented, nobody knew what could be inside. Luckily, the one the students were going to didn't hold any secrets and had been used for many years as training grounds for all kinds of people. Nothing could possibly go wrong there. 
That night, Ava went through all her gear and worried if she was underprepared. She constantly thought about what else she should bring and repeatedly asked Dirk if there was anything else he could think of. He just sighed and shook his head after a while. They had only been told to bring themselves and their main gear like armor and weapons. Everything else would be given to them, so Dirk wasn't concerned about not having food, water, or anything for a long-term trip. It didn't look like this would be long-term anyway. With that, Dirk forced Ava to go to bed, not bothering to make her go back to her dorm. She went to sleep with an anxious and overly excited mind. Dirk was the same, except that only made it so he went to sleep thirty seconds after his head touched the pillow instead of ten. Dirk! I can't find my axe. Do you know where Dash? Couch. Oh. That's right. As the sun crept over the horizon, Ava bustled about Dirk's little house. He paid no attention as he pointed out her items and prepared his own. This time, he obviously didn't plan to go in cloth clothes. Dirk put all his armor on and equipped his weapons. He tied all the knife sheets around his body and slotted in the knives. The hatchet was put on the back of his waist while the spear was taken apart into two pieces. That was actually a nifty feature Dirk's mother let him know about. Spears were long and could get in the way, so some of them were made to be taken apart. Dirk put the two pieces on each thigh for easy access. Lastly, his quiver of arrows was put across his back, as was the bow. With that, Dirk was prepared. Any of his weapons could be easily drawn and none of them, except for the bow, got in the way at all. Even the bow wasn't much of a nuisance. Under his armor, Dirk wore his normal workout clothes. The cloth both kept him comfortable and prevented the leather from rubbing against his skin. Plus, he didn't mind sweating in these clothes, so everything worked out. In less than five minutes, Dirk was totally prepared to go to battle. However, Ava had a hard time preparing herself despite everything being in front of her. Dirk had to help her put things on to move it along, and even then she triple-checked everything. In the end, Dirk was dragging her out of the house, saying that she could deal with whatever came with just the things she had. The two walked across campus after that fully geared up. They stuck out quite a bit among other crowds of normal students, but instead of looking like clowns, everyone glanced at them with an impressed gaze. After all, everyone who looked at them were either first years who thought they looked awesome, or upperclassmen who commended them for their bravery. They weren't the only ones either. Along the way, they could see many of their classmates dressed in gear as well. They all gathered in various groups, and by the end when they approached the arena, there were several large clusters of students marching through the doors. It looked like a small army was invading. They packed into the empty arena, finding many staff members and some teachers. One of them guided everyone to gather where they officially began the day. Attention! Today will be your first dungeon dive. Everyone should have come in their gear and with any weapons they need. Those who have forgotten anything, well, tough luck. Now listen up. Each of you will be handed a bag filled with essential items, including a list of all the items within. These are the minimum you should take with you in any dungeon dive in the future. The bag and everything inside are yours to keep, but this will be the only time you receive these things for free. Should you lose or destroy anything, you will need to go out and get it again yourselves. Now there are some things that we will not be providing that are somewhat essential, such as extra pairs of clothes. For this dive however, you will not need any. Now come receive a bag. With that, the teacher called everyone forth. A few staff members began tossing bags out of carts which students went up to catch. Dirk and Ava grabbed theirs, both quickly looking at the list inside the bag. Tent, two blankets, some food rations, medical bandages, some bags of water, and toiletries. Seems thorough enough. Dirk nodded at the kit. The bag wasn't that big and could easily be slung over one shoulder. The tent was obviously meant for sleeping, and while the blankets weren't thick, he found that they were great insulators. With them and one's clothes, keeping warm wouldn't be a problem. The food rations were dried meats and breads, rather basic but good fuel. Then there were the toiletries which were a given. Everything here was enough to allow one to survive in a foreign place comfortably. 
while the food and water wouldn't last them forever, they didn't need it this time. The teacher explained after everyone received their bags. These items are enough for you to survive a few nights while out of contact with the world. Now, worst comes to worst, water mages and fire mages are the two most sought after members of any diving party. Water mages can create water to drink, and fire mages can create fire to cook meats from various monsters. With these two, a party can survive almost indefinitely. There are also earth mages who can create little buildings to sleep in at night, and air mages are good for detecting monsters in the dark. Each element has its specialties that make it valuable to members in any party. However, sometimes a party won't have all the elements. Sometimes there will be no fire mage or no water mage. In this case, you must prepare accordingly. There are things like fire starters to make a fire and water cleansers to take water from different sources. These things are luxuries that you must acquire yourself depending on your party composition. Naturally though, getting a diverse array of elemental mages in a party is the most valuable thing you can do. And speaking of, it's time to form your parties. Getting to this point, all the students perked up. Upon hearing him, Ava moved a bit closer to Dirk, while Dirk noticed Alex step into his field of view. Students all around started to find their friends. Dungeon diving is never done alone. That is something only the most powerful have the privilege of doing. There are a variety of strategies and preferred group counts, but for now you all will be going by what we say. Each of you will assemble into groups of five people. For this dungeon dive, there will be no less. If you wish to make a group of more, be my guest, but it must not exceed seven. Now, we will give you fifteen minutes to find your friends and gather into groups. If by the end there are unassigned people, you will be automatically assigned by us. Now, go. As soon as the teacher finished, all the students immediately began yelling. It was a frenzy as everyone rushed every which way, calling out names. Ava put her shoulder against Dirk's as the people around them came crashing in. At the same time, Dirk watched as Alec made his way over with a friend. Everyone made sure to avoid bumping into the charismatic knight. Alec was dressed in different armor than what he wore for the tournament. This armor was still made with scales, but they were dark blue in color. The scales layered on each other around the vital areas while they were tailored for the joints to maintain mobility. On his back, a medium-sized sword was sheathed, while a knife was sheathed on his hip. He held his helmet under his arm while his bag was slung over his shoulder. Dirk! How about we group up? He spoke as he stopped next to him. Dirk pondered while Ava quickly opened her mouth. Sure. Who's your friend? This is Harmit, an earth mage. He doesn't train anima so the only item he has is a shield, but his magic more than makes up for it. How do you do? Harmit put his hand out, shaking Ava's. He then turned to Dirk and nodded to him, Dirk nodding back. Alec smiled. All right. Now we need one more. I have a friend I could probably find. Ava offered while Alec pondered. H.M., maybe. The fifth person is going to be what's called a porter though. Porter? Ava tilted her head at the unfamiliar term. Alec explained. A porter is someone who will carry all the bags and luggage. We can't be worrying about our items when a monster appears, so we need someone to take care of them for the group. However, this person won't be fighting much in exchange, at least not as much as everyone else. We should get someone who's okay with that. Oh, I see. But who would be fine with that? I think there would be plenty of people. Here. Saying that, Alec turned and looked around a bit before laying eyes on someone. It was a boy who didn't look like he had a group. Alec walked over to him, stunning the boy. The two conversed for only ten seconds before the boy nodded and walked back with Alec. All right, this is Jackson, and he'll be our fifth member. And nice to meet you all. Jackson stammered as he waved to the group. Inwardly, he was screaming. This group consisted of the top three students in the entire class. There was no more powerful group, and he was just invited to it. 
Jackson couldn't be happier at the moment, though he felt incredibly intimidated when he looked at Dirk's blank gaze that seemed to peer to his very soul. Chapter 42, Dungeon All right. Time's up. Not long after Jackson joined the group, the teacher made everyone stop. The students had mostly formed groups. Groups of five or six were scattered all throughout the arena. In total, there were a bit over 200 students, and most were in groups. There were only around 40 who were still unassigned. After the 40 were brought forward, the teacher simply divided them all up into groups of five. With that, every student was in a group. Now that all of you have your party, make sure you don't lose them. Just know that you won't be allowed to enter the dungeon if you aren't in a group of five. Now, all of your groups will be further divided into five. There are five lesser dungeons around the city, and you will be split among them. You will also have your leaders, so follow their directions. And since you will be going into the city, I will warn you beforehand, no wandering. Stray away from the group and disciplinary action will be taken. Now, wait as we divide you. With that, several teachers came out and began moving the groups of students. It wasn't long until all the 200 students had been divided into five bigger groups. After that, the leaders of each group led their students out of the arena one by one. Dirk's group was second to go, and when they did, Jackson hoisted everyone's bags, taking to his job easily. Alec gave him a thumbs up as they walked out. The place they went to was the plaza just outside of the academy gates. There were dozens of ordinary citizens that walked around, but all of them stayed a distance from the carriages parked in lines. Dirk's large group was walked to the carriages and then packed into several of them, each group getting their own carriage. All the bags were thrown into a storage area as Dirk's group boarded. On one side, Dirk sat down with Ava. The three others took to the other side, looking at the two with a smile. Not long after, there was a shout, and the carriage started moving. Dirk's group all looked out the window as they moved into the bustling streets of the city. As he listened to the wooden wheels roll against stone, Dirk closed his eyes and dove into a bit of a trance, obviously not interested in interacting with anybody. However, instead of allowing silence to prevail, Alec quickly spoke. So have you guys heard about what we're doing? Hearing him, Dirk's eyes opened, slightly unhappy that he wanted to converse. After glancing at Alec, he closed his eyes again, and Ava answered. I haven't. Well I have. Today they're only going to be training us on basic things. Like how to navigate a dungeon, what to look for, the monsters inside, and some survival skills along with some combat. I believe this is actually a two-day dive, so we will be staying the night within the dungeon. Then we'll head home at the end of the second day. After that, we're on our own for any dives we want to do. Really? Two days of training and that's it? Ava questioned surprisedly. Alec nodded as he shifted into a more comfortable position. Well other than some basic strategies, there's not much the teachers can teach. The only thing they would be good for is protection, and obviously we won't have anything like that in the future. People learn best through experience, so after giving us something of a foundation, they're leaving us to our own devices. I get that, but why would anyone want a dungeon dive then? Other than fighting monsters, there's not much to do there. Actually, there is. Alex smiled at her. For one, dungeons are a huge source of money. People are always in need of monster parts, the stronger the better obviously. Two, dungeons are the perfect place to practice spells and work on your magic. To become a great mage, you need to understand magic, which requires using magic. You can't do that just anywhere, so we use dungeons as hunting grounds. Three. Cultivating a higher tier requires materials, which requires money. And four, getting better gear requires money, and this can help maintain your life so you actually have a chance at raising your tier. So the dungeons are all about money. Pretty much. Alec nodded at her conclusion. Powerful people require wealth. That's how the empire's hierarchy works. The more powerful you are, the better position you receive and the more money and influence you have. Dirk's parents are Marquises, a position earned by his father being one of the most powerful people in the world. 
that power naturally comes with huge influence and money which he can use to build himself and his family higher. Alex spoke with flourishing hand gestures. Getting to this point, Dirk's eyes finally opened, and he looked at Alec. Thinking for a second, the status of Dirk's parents wasn't exactly a big secret. Dirk was just surprised by someone speaking of it so casually. Alec met Dirk's gaze and spoke. My parents are also Marquises, though they work in a different industry, so I doubt you know them. And Ava, I believe your parents are Earls. Why yes. You know that? Ava tilted her head at him, a bit self-conscious at the mention of her parents. My father has taught me all things political since I was young. Knowing anyone with any form of influence is one of the things he had me do. Knowing names is very valuable. Harmit's parents are also earls. However, I'm not sure what level your parents are at, Jackson. Alec turned to Jackson, whose eyes were bulging a bit. Hearing the implied question, he shrank back with a red face. And my parents are barons. He scratched his head, feeling even more embarrassed. Barons were the lowest of all nobles, a level below a viscount which was a level below an earl. Ava and Harmit were kings compared to him, let alone Dirk and Alec. Right now, he felt like a peasant, and compared to them he may as well be. Being the group's porter didn't help that feeling either. Alec just chuckled though. Hey, don't sweat a guy. You got into the academy, which means you alone could elevate your entire family. Just work hard. All right. Jackson nodded, Alec's charisma brightening his mood and boosting his determination. Alec wasn't wrong either. There were many like Jackson who barely got into the academy and were using it to help their family. With the academy's abundant resources, anyone with talent and determination could become powerful and elevate their status. There were many examples of such happenings, and it was very possible. After all, the empire wanted a strong population, and there were many hidden talents among the lower class. This was why the academy was one of the most sought-after institutions not only in the empire, but in the world. Jackson knew this, and he couldn't help but feel elated with Alec's words of encouragement. It was his dream to raise his tear and support his family. The group talked for a while longer as the carriage rolled down the streets. Alec made smooth conversation the entire way, and while Dirk never spoke much, Ava, Jackson, and Harmit made up for that. Everyone seemed to bond a level by the time they exited the city. Dirk watched as they rolled up to the city gates. In all his life, he had never been so far away from home. The city itself was a couple dozen miles wide, so while it wasn't exactly far, it felt that way for Dirk who had always existed only a couple miles from his house. He took in the unfamiliar sight of the city walls with a surprised gaze. The city walls, and by extension the gates, were over 100 meters tall. Dirk felt like the pure white surface of the walls was emanating power as they got closer. He had to crane his neck to see the top, and when he saw the 30-meter thick sides, he wasn't sure what to say. My God! Ava was similarly stunned. Each person in the group was sticking their head out the window to see. The students in the other carriages were the same. The walls were a significant display of power by the Horizon Empire. The carriage driver was stopped by a guard for only a second before they were let through. The carriage passed the walls and entered another area around the main capital city. While buildings were fewer, the city didn't stop after the walls. Especially as they came upon their destination. A large hill with a black mouth for an entrance stood menacingly in the distance. Surrounding the dark cave was a bustling town almost as prosperous as the capital city itself. Paved roads, stone buildings, and people of all shapes and sizes wandering the streets. These weren't normal people though. Of all the people that Dirk saw, many were dressed in armor and carried weapons. We're here. The driver announced, and the five stepped out. As Dirk hopped off the carriage, he noticed how many eyes landed on him and the other students. A few more carriages pulled up after his, deploying excited students. When all the carriages arrived, their teacher called them all over. Listen up. We're all going to stay together as we go to the dungeon. Follow me, and no wandering. Keep your party in check. 
Now let's go. The teacher waved them over, and the large group started walking. They drew many eyes as they traveled past all the buildings and businesses. Dirk saw hybrids, some dwarves, and plenty of humans among the crowds. As they walked, Alec leaned over and spoke in a low voice. These people look powerful, but I can assure you that there's nobody here at Tier 5. All these people are around Tier 3, Tier 4 at most. And actually, most may not be mages. Over half are likely warriors, so they would be around rank 3. Really? But wouldn't that make us as powerful as them? Ava asked, surprised. She was feeling a bit intimidated by all the seemingly powerful people walking around. They reeked of blood and looked mean. But if what Alex said were true, she could easily fight against them all. Alex smiled. We are about as powerful despite being so young. It's because of this talent that we made it into the academy. Most people like the ones around us have low affinities around 30 or 40 percent, and that's if they have an attribute at all. A large majority can only train anima. Wow. Ava and Jackson were surprised, looking at the people around them a bit differently. It sounded like Alec was bragging or putting them down, but that was the hard truth of the world. Most people around the world couldn't train anything, and only some could train either anima or magic. Even less had high affinities, so it could be seen how rare talent was. Ava sighed. She couldn't imagine living for so long to only be at the level she was now. It would be like her never improving for the rest of her life. She felt sorry for them. But there was nothing she could do. They all kept walking, and soon arrived in front of the dungeon. All the students looked into the void that was the entrance. It was a black barrier that flowed like a murky swamp, ripples of space waving across the surface. Seeing that, none of the students could even think of traveling through it. Unfortunately for them, the teacher was quick to discuss things with the guard who monitored the entrance. When he walked back, he yelled. Time to enter. Just walk through the entrance as normal. If you need to, hold the hand of your party members as you walk in. There may be a bit of discomfort, but it shouldn't affect you all too much. Now follow me. With that, the teacher walked in. The void rippled around him as he disappeared from view. Seeing that, a few brave students rushed to enter, sticking their hands in first before stepping forward. After they disappeared without a hitch, more went forward. Alec was quick to pull his group forward. He, Harmit, and Jackson held hands as they pulled each other through, leaving Dirk and Ava behind. The two stragglers looked at each other before grabbing hands and going through. When Dirk's hand reached the surface of the entrance, he could feel the black liquid encompass him like a goo. It was like a thin but sticky film, though surprisingly, he didn't feel that uncomfortable. The film felt familiar as he dove into it more. Thinking about it, he likened it to the dark element. His hand stayed locked with Ava's as the two pushed through. The entrance was longer than Dirk expected, and before long his entire body was encompassed by the black fluid. In that moment of suspension when he was cut off from the world, he felt like he would become lost in the seemingly endless void that surrounded him. That feeling didn't last long though. Taking another step forward, the slight resistance from that fluid disappeared, and light returned to his eyes. He entered a new world. Pa! Oh my god! Right after him, Ava came crashing forward. She was a lot less calm than Dirk panicked by the same feeling of suspension that he felt. After realizing that she was okay though, she calmed her breathing. She then realized how tight her grip was on Dirk's hand and let go. Everyone who walked through the dungeon entrance was shaken a bit, each reacting in different ways. Some panicked like Ava, and others took it much worse and became nauseous. Eventually though, the large group gathered in front of the entrance. The teacher overlooked them all and nodded. Meanwhile, Dirk observed the new space he was in. The place they were in was a dark forest. The trees were tall, but there was little light. There also weren't any green leaves, only brown or gray ones. It was a gloomy place that seemed like something out of a nightmare. It only needed cobwebs everywhere and it would turn into a spider's nest. Odd thing was though, there was a stone structure in front of them. 
it looked like a small fort that blocked most of the entrance. It definitely didn't look natural and might not have been a part of the dungeon. This is the dungeon. If a dungeon has been explored, evaluated, and claimed, then there will usually be one of these buildings within it. This building is something we call a haven, and you can consider it a safe zone within a dungeon. It protects the entrance and acts as a beacon. Sometimes, depending on the dungeon, there will be multiple havens in various places throughout the whole dungeon. In this dungeon, there are three, one at the beginning right here, one in the middle, and one outside the king's hall. The teacher spoke as he pointed to the structure next to them. In every dungeon, there were two main aspects. One, if there were only one dominant monster species, then that species would be present throughout the dungeon. But if there were more than one, then there would be territories. These territories were dynamic and could change, even be affected by the people who came in to raid the dungeon. Two, in every dungeon, there was something called a king's hall. Each dominant species established something similar to a stronghold where their most powerful would reside. Basically, it was a boss room, only this room was special in that it was sealed in another space. The monsters within these halls were the most powerful in the entire dungeon. Because of these two aspects, there were always two main goals, the first was to collect resources from the regular monsters, and the second was to defeat the king. The king was sought after because he was not only made of more valuable materials, but one might attain a weapon or magical item. These items were mostly random and weren't dropped from the king itself, but the dungeon as a reward. It was unknown how, but the dungeons generated these valuable pieces of loot. While nobody knew why or how, nobody really cared either. It was a nice reward after a hard battle. Finally, there was one more special aspect to the dungeons. Instead of reproducing, the monsters within a dungeon respawned. This was another mysterious function that people didn't understand. Monsters didn't generally respawn near people, instead filling in empty gaps within a dungeon. While this respawning function seemed to remove the necessity of territories, kill enough of one monster and the other would begin to proliferate and spawn more. Monsters even had battles of their own within the dungeons if they were mutually hostile. These mysterious functions of the dungeon couldn't be explained well, and people had studied them extensively. However, there was one thing that seemed to make up for the seemingly all-powerful features of the dungeons. Over time, dungeons could run out of energy and collapse. It was said that lesser dungeons could take several years to run out of energy, after which monsters would stop spawning and the dungeons would destroy themselves. When one died, another popped up somewhere random. These places usually became towns and little centers of commerce with the new source of materials. This lesser dungeon they were in now was one such center of commerce, hence the town around it. Dirk thought about all these things that he had learned from the academy as he looked around. Seeing the gloomy forest around him, he was able to feel how vastly different this world was from Earth. The teacher led everyone into the haven as he spoke of the dungeon. When inside, they could see some guards who sat around at tables. The teacher disregarded them and found his own table, taking out a bag and setting it down. He opened it, revealing sheets of paper inside. All right, these are maps. Each group gets one. The maps will usually outline the general layout of the dungeon as well as the monster territories and monster levels. However, dungeons change, and you should never put your full trust in a map. Only trust the layout, not the stuff about the monsters. You don't want to walk into what you think is a weak area and then get surprised by a high-level monster. Now, you all should have learned how to read a map in your classes. It's time to apply that knowledge. Come grab them. Saying that, the teacher started handing out the maps. Alec went up and grabbed one, unfurling it in front of his group. Chapter 43, Gremlins Upon looking at the map, Dirk was immediately surprised at how large the dungeon was. According to the map, the King's Hall, which was on the opposite side of the dungeon from the entrance, was nearly 14 miles away. The dungeon was also 10 miles wide, making for a huge circle filled entirely with monsters. Luckily, there was at least a haven between the King's Hall and the entrance. Plus, there was only one monster species in this dungeon, 
so there wasn't any worry about territories. Dirk instantly documented the map with his AI. It looked like the entire terrain, while filled with forest, was flat. They would merely have to fight a straight path toward the haven in the middle of the dungeon to be safe. Dirk didn't think a seven-mile hike would be that difficult or take that long even with monsters. Of course, this depended on what the monsters were. Luckily, the map told him. The monster that dominates this dungeon is known as a gremlin. It's less intelligent than a goblin and doesn't wield weapons, but they're agile and can gang up on you if you're not careful. They're also not the most hostile, but they are very capable of killing you and willing to do it. Their attacks aren't deep as they stick to using claws and teeth if they get close. Because of this, they like to take swipes with their long arms and keep their distance. Their only redeeming factor is the fact that they're noisy, so it isn't hard to know if one is nearby. The teacher spoke out loud, and all the students listened intently. It wasn't their first time hearing about the gremlin as they had been taught about many monsters at school, but they still took in every detail. They would be facing this monster, so it was different than simply seeing it in a book. The gremlin was a skinny creature only a bit shorter than the students here. It had abnormally long arms, sharp claws, pale white skin, and red eyes. From what Dirk had read, it wasn't the brightest monster, often making stupid decisions. Many would wander out on their own and could be picked off easily. However, should they group up, they could swarm you, and that would lead to a bad outcome. The more there were, the more hostile they became. It could be described as cowardly on its own and bold in a group. Other than that though, they were individually weak. This obviously depended on its rank. As gremlins couldn't train magic, they could only excel physically. In this dungeon, the strongest gremlin was the rank 4 king inside the king's hall. The rest were around rank 2, rank 3's only present in the deeper areas of the dungeon. Dirk wondered why the dungeon had such weak monsters in it, but when he remembered that this was merely a lesser dungeon, he thought it made sense. He then wondered about the strength of the monsters within major dungeons. It was said that those monsters were at least tier 4, with most being tier 5. If that was the case, would the king be a tier 6 or 7? Dirk wasn't even sure the kind of power a tier 7 could display. The teacher talked about the gremlin more and strategies for combating it. Apparently, the most valuable part of a gremlin was its eyes. The red eyes were used in some low-level alchemical potions, so they could be easily sold, albeit not for much. Getting to this point, the teacher finally decided to take the students out into the forest in order to show them some strategies. All the students' hearts pounded as they walked among the dark trees. Every rustle was met with paranoid eyes. All right, I want you to separate into your groups. Then, I want you to arrange yourselves in a square with your fifth man in the middle. The one in the middle should be the one who either doesn't use melee weapons or should be protected from close combat. If there are six in your group, then put the extra two both in the middle. The students listened to the teacher, quickly arranging themselves. Alec took to leadership and placed Jackson in the middle while the rest took up spots around him. With that, Jackson wouldn't be caught off guard and could keep himself and the luggage protected. Once all the groups were arranged, the teacher went around and corrected mistakes. Once everyone was in their right places, he nodded. Good. This is how your group should walk through the forest. Obviously you don't have to stick right next to each other. Some distance is fine so you can use your weapons on short notice. As long as you have your zone covered and your middle man protected, you're fine. You will come to figure out the details and what's comfortable as you work with your party more. This is also one of the reasons why people shouldn't change parties so much. Coordination between party members is one of your most valuable assets in any dungeon dive. Now, let's go find a gremlin. And don't worry about being injured too much. I'm here to prevent anything serious from happening. Saying that, the teacher urged everyone deeper into the forest. The groups all began to walk forward slowly, constantly watching around them and listening for anything out of the ordinary. Along the way, many groups fell out of formation, and the teacher constantly corrected them. He spoke seriously and with urgency, and all the students quickly fixed themselves. Unfortunately, 
the teacher knew that they wouldn't see the true value of a formation until they got into battles, so he just tried his best to emphasize its importance. The groups all walked for around ten minutes, going so far that nobody was sure where the haven was anymore. Luckily, there were landmarks around the forest in the form of metal pillars with soft lights on them. Each pillar pointed to where the nearest haven was, so if one ever got lost, they were supposed to look for the pillars to find their way. Though, they weren't everywhere, so having a strong sense of direction was most valuable. This was one of the things Dirk started appreciating. His AI could map out and track where he had gone, so he would never get lost. It marked where each pillar was as well, adding it to the map. Eventually, all the groups suddenly heard rustling. Along with the rustling came rough cries like that of a monkey. Not long after, a gremlin came into view. It was exactly as described. The gremlin swung across branches, but stopped when it saw one of the groups. Its long arms hung from the branch and its red eyes glowed. It didn't seem like it would attack, and the students nearest to it entered a standoff. After some time though, the gremlin cried out and moved again. It circled around the group, getting closer and dropping to the floor. The students panicked and prepared their weapons, watching as the gremlin inched closer. Then, it dove in. The gremlin reached out and swiped at the closest student. The boy who received the attack stumbled backward with his sword pointed forward. The pitiful sword swing missed the arm that was heading for him, and the claws came poking forward. Ack! The boy grunted as the claws cut through his sleeve and scratched his arm, leaving three new slices. The gremlin backed away as one of the other party members came forward with a swing. It then swiped once more, cutting the other kid before backing away and taking off into the trees again. It likes to harass its prey. This was the conclusion Dirk came to as he watched from afar. The gremlin never made for a lethal blow, simply wanting to inflict small wounds. It really wasn't that hostile, and if the students were even a bit competent, it wouldn't last long under any sort of attack. The fact that it dove in toward a group showed how unintelligent it was. The teacher went over after the gremlin escaped into the forest with a laugh, taking a look at the students who got scratched. The scratches weren't any more than flesh wounds, and the kids could keep fighting despite not wanting to anymore. They didn't get a choice as they were forced to bandage their own wound and keep walking. The groups eventually resumed their march, and it wasn't long before another gremlin came swinging over. Nobody knew if it was the same one, but nobody cared. Dirk watched as it made its way to his group. Alex saw this too and perked up. Harmit, you take it. Alex spoke, and the gremlin heard. Harmit nodded as the gremlin turned toward them. Dirk could see the man around Harmit fluctuate. The gremlin approached, just like with the other group. Alex stood in front but didn't draw his weapon. The gremlin inched forward, crying out occasionally as its fingers twitched. Then, when the gremlin dove toward Alec to swipe, an arrow came hurtling forward. Screech! The gremlin screamed as a rock arrow shot through its stomach and pinned it to the floor. Without hesitating, Alec then moved forward with his sword, swinging it at the gremlin. Slice! With a clean stroke, the gremlin's head fell, its body collapsing lifeless. The teacher walked over the next moment, looking at the gremlin before nodding. Very good. Perfect teamwork and execution. Now, if you so choose, there are two things you can harvest from this monster. First is the magic crystal, and the second is the eyes. It looks like the magic crystal in this monster is in the back of its head. Uh. Hearing that, Alec hesitated. While earning money out of his own efforts sounded nice, it required him to scoop the eyes out of a gremlin and dig into its head. That didn't sound appealing in the slightest. Subconsciously, he found himself turning to Dirk as if asking for help. Ava also looked at Dirk like he were the perfect man for the job. Seeing this, Dirk thought for a second before shrugging and drawing one of his knives. Approaching the severed head, Dirk flipped the face up and looked at the shut eyelids. Taking his knife, he dug straight in. All the students who watched cringed at the horrible sounds his knife made against flesh. A few seconds later, the teacher's eyebrows raised. In the palm of Dirk's gloves were two red eyeballs. 
he set them aside before flipping the head over and stabbing into the head. He could also sense a cluster of dense mana, so he assumed that's where the crystal was. And sure enough, the crystal was planted within the back of the skull. He cracked bone before pulling it out and cleaning it off. The crystal was a marble with swirling earth and mana inside. It looked mesmerizing when you disregarded the dripping blood. After collecting the two eyeballs and crystal, he stood and turned to the teacher who nodded in approval. Hmm, good job. Here's a bag to hold loot. When we exit the dungeon, I'll be taking you all to see the Dungeon Association. You can sell the loot there. Understood. Nodding, Dirk took the sack and threw the spheres in. He then handed the sack to Jackson who took it and tied it to his waist. After that, all the groups kept moving forward. Over the next hour, all groups would come face to face with a gremlin. Only some were able to kill it while others got hurt. The groups that did kill their gremlin though couldn't muster up the courage to harvest it. They all glanced at Dirk like Alec did. Seeing this, the teacher stepped in. You can ask others to help harvest for monsters. However, be prepared to give away some of the spoils. If you ask Dirk to help you, it's only fair that he take either both eyeballs or the crystal. If you're okay with this, then feel free to ask. As for you Dirk, don't let your services go to waste. Harvesting is a valuable skill, and you seem to be adept at it. Hearing this, the students and Dirk nodded. The groups who killed gremlins then asked Dirk to harvest for them. He went over and harvested everything, and since most groups wanted the crystals, he ended up with the eyes. In the end, he came out with six more eyeballs. However, there was one group that didn't ask for help. One of the students tried his own hand at it. The student had a knife of his own, and like Dirk, he went to cut out the crystal. This went fine, but not so much as he cut out the eyeballs. He had to dig around a bit to detach them, and when the eyeball came out, it had some cuts on it. The second one was a bit better, but still damaged. The teacher saw this and smiled. Good try, but those eyeballs are now worthless. Damaging it reduces its value to nothing. This is why a harvester is so valuable as even the crystals can be broken if not careful. They need to have the knowledge and dexterity necessary to avoid damaging the valuable parts. You can keep practicing, but know that you will probably come out with no sellable loot due to you needing to learn. Dirks are perfect, so if you asked him, you could have at least gotten one good eyeball. Just be sure to weigh your gains and losses. And if you truly desire, then go ahead and try to learn how to harvest. There are even some classes for it. The teacher left with words of encouragement. However, the student in question felt embarrassed and frustrated for messing up. Meanwhile, Dirk was learning the value of being able to use a knife well. The groups went on to march for another three hours. They encountered more and more gremlins, and the students quickly learned how to deal with them. Their confidence went up, and more were killed. Even when small groups of two or three gremlins showed, the groups met them with bravery. By the end, basically all the students were confident in their party's ability to handle a gremlin, and nearly all had killed one. Of course, more kills meant more harvesting, and Dirk was busy taking eyes from everyone. More students had also tried their hand at harvesting, but like the first kid, they all damaged the eyes. Seeing that, everyone chose to have Dirk help them. His bag was soon filled with fifty eyeballs and a few more crystals. While he was happy at the number, he was not happy with the stink that came from it. Luckily he didn't have to carry it, leaving Jackson to deal with the stench of dried eyeballs. It was at this time that the groups came upon another structure. Their eyes all widened as they saw the second haven. The teacher led them into it. All right, this haven is where we will be staying until tomorrow. For the rest of the day, you all will focus on setting up camp in an open area within the haven. If you finish that and have nothing to do, then you can take your party and go out to hunt more. However, you must find another party to go with you. Basically, groups of ten only can go out to hunt more. Also, should you go out to hunt, you must be back before darkness falls. Now, go find yourselves a space, and I'll walk you through setting up camp. The teacher spoke and walked them to an empty plot of land within the haven. 
the haven here was basically a large box with only a few buildings for the guards that maintained the place. The majority of the area was empty dirt and grass. All the groups spread out and found their own spaces, dropping their bags on the floor and taking everything out. The teacher went on to teach everyone how to pitch a tent. The tents were big enough to fit two people, even three should they squeeze, and everyone had a tent. The students drove stakes into the ground and propped up the spines with bendy metal rods and long rope. Soon, dozens of tents were made, and everyone settled down their blankets to make it a bit more homely. Their bodies also relaxed, fatigued from the march setting in. Most of them were tired from the elevated stress levels, so nobody was interested in going back out. Except for Dirk's group. Alec was quick to mention going back out to hunt, and his group agreed. Dirk and Ava weren't tired at all, while Alec and Harmit were only a bit tired. And since Jackson had been protected the whole time, he wasn't tired much either. With that, they asked to go back out. The teacher heard them and surprised them with his response. You guys performed the best today, so if you want, you can go back out yourselves. I trust that you can take care of yourselves. Especially you, Alec. Keep taking charge like that. Lack of leadership is one of the biggest downfalls of any group. Yes sir. We'll be back before darkness falls. Very well. Stay safe. The teacher nodded, and Alec quickly led his group out of the haven. Everyone was on higher alert as they entered the unknown without any support. The haven quickly disappeared from view as they chose a direction and walked. The atmosphere felt much different from before, but nobody in the group faltered. Dirk remained the same as ever, and Ava remained solid as long as he was. Meanwhile, Alec continued to be a good leader and the backbone for the other two. Harmit followed Alec and Jackson was supported by his charisma. The group was well balanced, and when a group of three gremlins came their way, they were able to take care of it with relative ease. Alec handled the first one, Harmit handled the second, and Ava handled the third. While it took Harmit two rock arrows and Ava three swings, all three gremlins were killed. And unlike when getting their first kill, nobody was queasy at the sight of a dead monster. Dirk then harvested all the eyes and crystal, tossing them into the half filled smelly sack of loot. Nice. So, where do you guys want to go? Deeper? Alec asked as Dirk handed the sack to Jackson. Everyone looked at him and pondered. Should we go deeper in? How strong are the gremlins? And won't there be more? The gremlins will indeed be stronger and more plentiful. But that's just more practice for us. Dirk has only killed a couple gremlins. We all gotta get our kill counts up. Even Jackson needs to kill some. Besides, these ones are too easy. We'll grow faster if we challenge ourselves. Hmm. Ava and Harmit pondered. The ones they were killing were truly easy. Hitting the gremlin a single time was enough to disable them. Rank 2s just weren't strong enough to withstand their strength. Ava was rank 3 herself, and Harmit was tier 3, not to mention Alec and Dirk. Plus, everyone was feeling a bit of bloodlust. After killing more and more, they felt the desire to keep going. They wanted to prove to themselves that they were capable, especially Ava. All her training was for this, and she wanted to display it. Dirk didn't particularly care either way, and since Jackson was being protected, he felt safe. After thinking about it for a while, everyone eventually agreed. With that, Alec turned them toward the deeper areas, marching forward at a steady pace. Chapter 44, Beacon The lone group of five walked over rocks, branches, and through bushes. Occasionally, they would encounter small groups of gremlins that were ultimately killed under their weapons and magic. They walked for an hour, only finding rank two gremlins. Eventually, they started encountering groups of four, five, and even six. These battles were a bit harder with the gremlins being a good bit more aggressive. One managed to cut Harmit, but that was about the extent of the injuries. With more gremlins appearing, Dirk was able to showcase a bit more of his skill. He took out the two pieces of his spear and put them together, wielding the spear to handle the gremlins that liked to rely on their reach. 
the spear proved to be the perfect weapon against these monsters. By the end of the hour, they constantly encountered groups of six, and their appearance came more often. However, nobody was fatigued. Even Harmit who used purely magic wasn't that tired. So, they decided to continue forward. It wasn't long before they encountered a group of eight. It was here that they had to slow down, taking time to handle the monsters that outnumbered them by three. Plus, these ones were a bit faster and more agile. They proved harder to hit for Ava, and the group had to come closer together in order to protect Jackson. In that battle, Dirk was able to rather easily handle three while Alec handled another two. Harmit then impaled two more while Ava finished her last one. By the end, they were almost shoulder to shoulder with Jackson between them all. That was a bit tougher. But damn was that fun. After killing the last one, Alec chuckled. The others also smiled while Dirk cleaned his spear blade with a cloth. He wasn't as happy as the others. For Alec, Ava, and Harmit, while feeling bloodlust was rather exciting, for Dirk it was the opposite. In that battle, he got the same tunnel vision as he did with the goblin at the first kill initiation. While it wasn't as bad, getting it at all was concerning. He continued to feel that excessive desire for combat and killing. He was all the more aware of the fact that there was something inside of him that pushed him to fight. He felt the need to destroy and lose control. It felt good, but didn't at the same time. He stood there and frowned subconsciously, pondering what it could be that was haunting his rationale. The others didn't notice as they asked him to harvest the bodies and continue moving forward. It wasn't long before they met another group of nine gremlins. They all surrounded the group and pounced, two on each person. Alec killed one easily before taking a scratch to the armor. Ava swung her axe, but missed both, taking two swipes that scraped the leather over her arms. Harmit managed to pin one before quickly backpedaling into Jackson, knocking them both over. It was Dirk, who had killed both of his, that saved them from the other gremlin. After saving them, Dirk turned and quickly observed the others. Alec went into a standoff with his second gremlin while Ava managed to cut one of hers in half after using some extra strength. However, Dirk quickly discovered another that was up in a tree. This gremlin was bigger, had darker skin, and longer claws. It was clearly stronger than the ones they had faced so far. It was a rank 3. The rank 3 jumped down, suddenly charging toward Alec who was still focusing on his second gremlin. It was surprisingly silent as it approached, showing skill in navigating a forest. It came from the side, but when Alec noticed it, the gremlin did something surprising. It scooped some dirt and hurled it at Alec's face. The dirt accelerated unnaturally and got in his eyes, blinding him. The gremlin then shot out its clawed fingers towards Alec's neck, causing goosebumps to break out all over his body. He was blind and only knew that the gremlin would definitely take the chance to hurt him. However, just before the gremlin sliced his neck open, a rock pillar came surging out from the floor between them, hitting the gremlin right in the gut. Bang! The gremlin was knocked away as Alec fell to the floor with his hands on his face. After that, the second gremlin he had yet to kill found a spear flying straight into its chest. Dirk's body then appeared, hatchet in hand as he pushed off of another pillar straight toward the rank 3 gremlin. Screech! The gremlin screamed as it stabilized itself, preparing for Dirk. Dirk's body rushed straight toward it. The gremlin slashed down with its claws, but then it suddenly felt a burning sensation at the elbow. Dirk had chopped out with ruthless precision. It looked over and found its arm cut in half, the forearm falling to the floor. As it screamed in pain, Dirk brought back his arm for another swing. The hatchet hurtled straight toward its collarbone. However, Ava, who had finished her battle and turned to watch, felt her eyes widen. The gremlin had shot out its other hand toward Dirk's body as he brought down the hatchet. At this rate, it would cut through the leather and dig into his stomach. She yelled. Watch out! Splat! Blood splashed as the hatchet buried itself in the gremlin's surprisingly tough body. Ava felt herself freeze as her eyes looked toward the gremlin's other hand. It was stopped right next to Dirk's ribs by the man himself. 
in Dirk's hand was a knife that he planted right through the gremlin's palm, halting it in its tracks. She was stunned as the gremlin collapsed to its knees. With that, Dirk ripped out and swung his hatchet again, taking off its head. Thud. The head hit the dirt, and Dirk pulled back his arm with the knife while the body fell. He sheathed the knife and the hatchet, turning back to check on the others. They were all looking at him, surprise written all over their faces. Hey, you okay? Ava came jogging over. He looked at her before taking his knife back out and wiping it off with a cloth. She sighed before knocking her fist against his shoulder. After he cleaned his knife and hatchet, he bent down to the gremlin's head, digging its eyes out. These ones were black instead of red and felt more like marbles. He imagined that they would sell for more. He then dug around for the crystal, eventually finding a big one. This one swirled with even more earthen mana that was a deep brown color. Walking back to the group, he opened the bag on Jackson's waist, taking out two of the red eyeballs and tossing in the better loot. The bag had already been filled, so they stopped collecting normal stuff. Hey, nice battle. Thanks for saving my skin. Alec came over after wiping his face, patting him on the shoulder. Dirk nodded. Sure. That gremlin looks different. Rank 3 maybe? Definitely rank 3. It was stronger and had different eyes. It used magic too. Yeah, that dirt throw hurt. We must really be getting deep then. If we move deeper, we'll definitely encounter more. We shouldn't. I agree, but why do you think so? Alec smiled at him. He thought that Dirk was taking into account their lack of skill, and Alec knew that they couldn't handle many rank threes. They were faster, stronger, could use magic, and the group didn't have the ability to keep up, especially if there were more rank twos to distract them. However, Dirk gave a different answer than expected. It's getting darker. He pointed to the forest, and everyone looked around. The forest was already dark, looking like a foggy swamp in the evening. But that darkness was the daytime in this place. While it was hard to notice, it had gotten even darker. Dirk barely noticed this, and after bringing it up, the others noticed too. The teacher said to be back before dark. Now that it was getting darker, they were probably late, not that they knew when darkness fell anyway. Alec took a look around and nodded. That's true. Then we should probably head back. This far is our limit anyway. Although. Getting to that point, he spun around a few times. Because it had gotten darker, it was difficult to know which way was back. The trees and bushes all looked the same, and he had been distracted in the battle. He didn't know which way to go. Sensing his concern, Dirk pointed. We need to head back that way. Really? Yes. There's a pillar not far from here. Hmm, all right then. I don't have any better clue. Let's go then. I don't want to camp outside in monster territory tonight. Nodding in agreement, everyone situated themselves. Jackson hoisted his bags while Dirk retrieved his spear, the group quickly marching off. While they had to fight another group sooner than expected, there at least wasn't a rank three, so they finished quickly and headed to the pillar. And sure enough, there was a pillar that pointed them toward the haven. Everyone smiled as they followed the arrow, making haste as the forest around them got darker and darker. Unfortunately, they didn't move quickly enough. The forest soon became pitch black, the group barely able to see a few meters in front of them. They all stopped as Alec cast a spell, a ball of light appearing above his palm. The surroundings were illuminated by bright white light. Dirk remembered that he had the light attribute at that moment. Nice. Now we can actually see Dash. Screech. Ava spoke in relief but was interrupted by a shrill scream. Everyone looked around and could see red eyes light up around them in the darkness beyond. There were at least twenty, and Dirk quickly remembered a saying at that moment. Behind every red dot were five more that you couldn't see. We need to hurry. Dirk spoke, and everyone nodded. The gremlins were obviously being attracted to the light, but if they turned it off, they wouldn't be able to see. That meant that if they didn't want to fight tons of gremlins, they needed to get back to the haven quickly. Go! 
Screech! Alec shouted, and the gremlins around them screamed. The group started running through the forest as leaves rustled behind them. Their hearts beat out of their chest as they looked back and saw even more red eyes. Gremlins began to rush them from the sides. Ha! Slice! Alec shouted as he swung his sword, cleaving a gremlin in half. He continued to run but was thrown off balance, so he slowed down. The group stayed with him so they slowed down too. This allowed more gremlins to get close. Slice! Dirk slowed as he thrust his spear, stabbing the chest of a gremlin. He pulled back and caught back up with the group. Their running speed quickly became a fast walk as they fended off the gremlins that dove toward them. Over several minutes, ten gremlins fell. Then twenty fell. They kept killing the gremlins that rushed toward the light. Even Jackson was occasionally swinging his weapon. Half an hour passed as they continued to kill gremlins. Harmit had labored breathing, as did Alec. Harmit could only use magic, but his mana wasn't infinite. Meanwhile, Alec only had limited stamina. Their killing speed went down, and Ava and Dirk had to compensate. Jackson was already out for the count as he stuck close for protection. The gremlins began to overwhelm them. The five continued to walk though. For the first time ever, Dirk began to yell and shout. Harmit slowed down as fatigue built up. A sense of desperation arose within him as distance grew between him and the group. He wanted to shout for Alec, but he needed to breathe. He looked at Alec's back with helplessness. However, at that time, he felt a hand grip his armor. Keep moving! Don't stop! Dirk yelled at Harmit who slowed down. Harmit looked at him with shock as he grabbed him and shoved him forward. Alec and Ava's eyes also went wide, though they didn't dare take their eyes off of the monsters in front of them. From then on, the leader of the group changed hands, and Dirk actively guided the four along the shortest path toward the haven. But even he started having a hard time. Too many gremlins pressed in from all sides, and his mind worked faster and faster to keep up with the changes. Eventually, something within him triggered, and his AI popped up with a notification. High stress combat detected. Multiple threats detected. Generating combat scheme. Kill orders formed. Combat assistance activated. Happy hunting. Slice. Dirk's knife sliced a gremlin's head off. The next moment, displays lit up in his vision while the light coming into his eyes was enhanced, giving him something like night vision. All the gremlins around him were highlighted as the AI took in information from all his senses, primarily sight, sound, and touch. Every little detail was captured, and he was given optimal killing orders to enable the most efficient death of each enemy. He smiled as he indulged in the familiarity. At the same time, he didn't realize how much he was enjoying the battle, a sense of bloodlust surging from within. Dirk rushed around activating the anima in his body to kill gremlins faster as more appeared. He also cast earth spells, spikes of rock shooting out of the floor and impaling oncoming gremlins. But they just kept coming, the light acting as a beacon. Alec huffed as he struggled to swing his sword, and even Ava was getting fatigued, deciding to use magic instead of swinging her axe. Harmon had also run low on mana, not daring to use any more so he could concentrate on running. Only Dirk was constantly moving around them with a smirk. He had reverted to using his hatchet and his knife as he was put on the defense. Blood soaked his front as he engaged in close combat while tossing in spells when the situation called for it. Whenever someone was about to be attacked, he was there to protect them. They eventually got used to his assistance as they just focused on doing as much damage as they could. Due to this, they had basically bundled together right next to him. Then, the AI came back with another notification. Combat scheme generated. Applying. With that, Dirk received an infusion of data. He immediately understood the gremlins' attack patterns and habits. Basically, every aspect such as their weaknesses and behaviors associated with combat was grasped. With that information, Dirk was able to increase his efficiency, his killing speed rising a notch as he incapacitated every gremlin by slicing tendons or destroying vital areas. 
All this information was obtained by fighting dozens of gremlins and analyzing every wound he dished out. The group retreated like this for over an hour with Dirk dishing out the most precise of attacks where they were needed, though perhaps with a bit more brutality than his more rational self would like. His group's attacks were also accounted for while determining what enemies to attack. The gremlins became sparser as they continued forward, but everyone's energy also dwindled. Jackson and Harmit were barely walking while Alec could only cast a few fire spells here and there. Even his light was dwindling, reducing their vision. But Dirk and Ava held strong. Dirk compensated for his group's exhaustion while calling upon his mana lungs to fill him with mana, rapidly casting spells with the assistance of his AI. The magic circles that appeared above the backs of his hands were difficult to see, a result of his proficiency rapidly rising and the introduction of silent casting. However, Dirk found himself with a bad headache, his mind's fatigue growing quickly. And while Ava was even more exhausted, she refused to leave everything to him. She eventually took his spear and used it instead of her axe, guarding one of the sides. Seeing this, Alec also mustered up the last dregs of his stamina, hoisting his sword. Harmit also decided to cast a couple more spells from his barely regenerated mana pool. Jackson, on the other hand, just did his best carrying the bags and staying out of the way. Finally, when everyone was on their last breaths, they could see the haven. They all felt a renewed sense of vigor as they rushed toward the open gate. However, at this moment, Dirk's AI picked up on another figure. It wasn't a gremlin, but a human. He flicked his head around and caught an image of his teacher coming from their side. I got you. Whoosh. The teacher yelled, and winds were suddenly kicked up. The group felt the air around them sharpen as invisible blades came down upon the gremlins attacking them. At once, all the gremlins in the surrounding area were diced into pieces, falling to the floor as nothing but limbs and chunks of flesh. Everything was suddenly quiet, the group looking around them with alert eyes. When the teacher walked over to them, they all snapped to him and prepared their weapons. Dirk also looked at the teacher with a ruthless gaze and violently steady breathing. Seeing that everything was okay though, he motioned to his group. Stand down. Thank you teacher. Hmm. Of course. Come, get inside the haven. The teacher waved them over. Alec, Ava, Harmit, and Jackson felt their nerves relax as they walked through the gate that shut behind them. Dirk's AI also exited its combat mode and calmed down. Inside, all the students had awakened and stared at the incoming party. Their eyes all went wide at their blood-soaked bodies. Red liquid dripped from their weapons, still fresh from the bodies it came from. When they entered the area full of tents, the smell of iron caused the students to recoil. They felt fear when they saw the group's menacing gazes. They could practically see the aura of violence. This was especially so for Dirk who looked around with a mean gaze. His eyes sent chills down people's backs. Come over here and wash up first. The teacher brought the group over to another room that had a few tubs within. Using a mana crystal, water filled the tubs. The group stripped their armor and took turns jumping into the tubs, their clothes still on to clean them along with their bodies. Dirk let everyone go first, and they didn't argue with him. Blood turned the water red, and when the first three boys came out after a while, the tubs had to be emptied and refilled for Dirk and Ava. Dirk stripped off his shirt before jumping in, Ava glancing at him as they settled in the tubs. That was crazy. Ava spoke as she and Dirk settled in the water with nobody around. He nodded, his rationale coming back and lust for combat reducing. His radiating body heat warmed the water rather significantly, and he decided to save recollecting the battle for later. He spoke to Ava. You fought hard. No, you fought hard. You were practically protecting all of us. You still fought hard. Any injuries? Just a few. My armor blocked a lot. Luckily they only scratch you. Hmm. We need to clean our wounds before going to bed. All right. With that, the two relaxed for a while before getting out of the tubs, their wet clothes sticking to their bodies. Ava was too tired to be self-conscious and simply let her fit body be on full display in front of Dirk. 
Lucky for her though, Dirk gave her his dry shirt that had been mostly protected from blood by his nice armor. She accepted it and took off her own wet shirt, putting his on. After drying off, Dirk grabbed his armor, intending to wash it. However, the teacher came in at that moment and stopped him. I'll take care of that for you. Dirk looked at the teacher, wondering why he was offering to help. He didn't stop him though as the teacher came and took his and the party's armor to another tub. Ava thanked him before pulling Dirk along. The two walked out, coming under everyone's gazes. As they walked to their camp area, many of the boys cursed at Dirk's sculpted body and stared at Ava's slender one that her clothes did nothing to hide. Despite being dirty, they were currently seeing her as one of the prettiest girls in the class. Upon getting to their camp area, the others were finishing pitching tents. The three looked like they would fall asleep any moment. Once the tents were finished, everyone took out their blankets. The bags and blankets had some bloodstains here and there, but none of them had the energy to care. The boys quickly piled into their tents after giving a quick good night. Seeing them so exhausted, Dirk and Ava smiled at each other before finding a spot to sit. Dirk went on to clean Ava's wounds with some of the medical supplies in the bag. She had several scratches along her arms. What caused her to gawk though was the fact that Dirk didn't have any wounds at all. She couldn't fathom how he could have killed as many gremlins as he did and not get hurt a single time. Then again, the combat ability he displayed was shocking enough. Shaking her head, she sat in front of Dirk as he treated her. She closed her eyes and lost herself in the sensation of his touch. After some time, her head fell forward, prompting Dirk to catch her. When he noticed she fell asleep, he smiled and finished bandaging her before putting her in her tent. He then entered his, his body relaxing as he laid himself down. He quickly fell asleep after, going into a deeper than normal slumber. Chapter 45 Money Ugh! I hurt! With a pained moan, Ava rolled her body over. She took deep breaths as her brain processed waking up. When she finally became lucid, she opened her tent and exited. The first thing she saw was Dirk sitting in the middle of their group's tents. Looking around, she noticed that it was oddly quiet. There was nobody around them, at least none that were awake. Not even the teacher was there. Good morning. Hmm. Where is everyone? Out hunting. Ha. Huh. Ava thought for a second before tilting her head. Without us? Everyone left around four hours ago. The teacher told us to rest for the day since we fought so hard last night. You guys need to recover, especially those three. Hearing him, Ava looked over to the three other tents where some snores originated from. She nodded. Alec, Harmit, and Jackson weren't as conditioned as them. And while Alec trained Anima, making his recovery easy, the others would have it much worse. She felt most sorry for Jackson who didn't excel as much as them. Though, he was being protected the whole battle, so that would compensate for the recovery. H.M. So what do we do until they come back? Eat. Dirk stuck out his hand. Ava looked over and took the food ration from him. He spoke again. You're probably sore, and that's cause you didn't eat last night. Always eat before you go to sleep. Though those three are going to have it worse. They didn't even clean their wounds. He smirked a bit, and Ava's concern grew. Just as she was about to go wake them up, she heard rustling, and Alec came out of his tent. Oh, you two are awake. Where is everyone? Out hunting. Ava dully responded exactly as Dirk did. Alec tilted his head. Without us? Well we sure aren't out there with them. Ha. Huh. Yeah. How are your guys' wounds? He chuckled at Ava's sarcastic retort before asking. Dirk looked at him and scanned his body. Surprisingly, he found no wounds at all, only the light remnants of some scratches. Ava sighed in response. I'm fine. Only need a few days to totally heal. What about you? My light attribute gives a bit of passive healing, so it looks like mine healed overnight. It's the other two you should be worried about. Hey Harmit, get up. Ugh. 
Alec yelled into his friend's tent, burning a groan. Harmit came stumbling out a bit later. His body looked ragged, but his eyes were sharp. Dirk saw this and nodded. When he drained his mana, he would often wake up with a clear mind the next morning. It was the same for Harmit. But a clear mind didn't mean a clear body. Harmit's body was riddled with scratches covered in dried blood. It didn't look like they healed at all, a result of them not being cleaned. His winces showed that they till hurt too. Oh, you need to get treated. Alec examined him with concern. Harmit just looked at him like he were dumb. The next moment though, Alec reached out his hand, and a soft light radiated onto one of Harmit's wounds. At a speed visible to the eye, scabs fell off and the wound began to clear up. The skin around it turned pink as it was healed, and when the light dimmed, a barely healed scar was left. It wasn't the most thorough healing, but it cleared up an entire wound. Dirk was a bit stunned, as was Ava. He didn't stop there either. Alec went on to heal several more wounds. The healing was light, barely sealing the skin, but that was more than good enough to bring Harmit back to full ability. It all happened in only a couple of minutes too. Meanwhile, Harmit didn't seem that surprised. Thanks. Sure. When Jackson gets up, I'll heal him too. What about you, Ava? Dirk? I'm alright. And Dirk didn't get wounded. Oh. Really? Surprised by what he was hearing, Alec walked over and looked at the shirtless Dirk. Not to mention wounds, Dirk looked to be in the prime of his life. After not seeing even a little bruise, he stopped and thought. So what you did last night was even more amazing than I thought. He spoke in wonder and slight suspicion. Ava and Harmit also began recollecting the night before. Needless to say, if it hadn't been for Dirk, none of them would have made it back as more than a dead pile of flesh. Things had gotten so chaotic so quickly, and it was Dirk's sheer skill and ability that kept them alive. It was he who assessed the situation perfectly throughout their entire retreat and acted to most efficiently keep the group alive. Not only that, but his sense of direction also seemed to be perfect since they wasted no time at all searching for the haven. If it were anyone else, they would have run aimlessly forever, the chaos clouding their judgment. By the time they realized that they needed to go toward the haven, they would have been lost, and it would have been too late. Dirk not only protected them but guided them back to safety. Ava could still remember the incredible display of combat he put on during the retreat. How reliable he was in handling the gremlins that became too much for them. In that moment, she saw him as the ultimate pillar of support. Nobody else could move through such a situation with the ruthless stability that he did. And it was this security that helped her keep her cool through the fight. She wasn't the only one. While the group didn't immediately break down, it was close to. It would only take one person giving out and dying to kill the morale and fight of the rest. But because of Dirk, that never happened. Dirk became their backbone. Ava already admired Dirk, but now his group did too. Alec looked at the stoic and quiet teen in a whole new light. He also looked back and sought to learn from Dirk's display. Not his combat skills, but his leadership. When everything went to hell, it was he that stepped up. Such a trait was most valuable in a proper leader. It earned respect, and Alec, who now respected Dirk, wanted to earn his own respect in that way. The three continued to ponder the night before. After a while, Jackson also woke up. The first thing Alec did was heal his surprisingly few wounds, earning him profuse thanks. Jackson then went on to thank the entire group for protecting him during the retreat. He knew that as high nobles, they had no obligation to help him. It was their valiance and honor that kept him alive. This was especially so for Dirk. Jackson thanked him the most as he knew just how much he protected them. As the one who didn't hardly fight, Jackson watched the others the entire time. The things he saw amazed him, but the way Dirk controlled the battle was unmatched. He knew that their being alive was all thanks to Dirk. Dirk wasn't great at receiving gratitude though. He looked at Jackson weirdly as he repeatedly shook his hand and sang praises. Eventually, he just tuned Jackson out with a blank face until he was finished. 
Ava stood there with a smile, finding humor in Dirk's struggle. From there, the five washed up once more and ate some food. By the time they were done, their teacher along with all the other students came back. All of them huffed as they went to their tents, light blood stains all over their armor. Seeing that Dirk's group was alive and humming, the teacher walked up to them with a smile. I came across your handiwork from last night. I'm impressed. Here. Saying that, the teacher tossed them a large bag. Alec caught it with both his hands and opened it up, finding a full sack of magic crystals and eyeballs. The numbers surprised even Alec. Tell me, how many gremlins do you think you guys killed last night? Uh. 867. Suddenly, Dirk blurted out the number. Everyone looked at him with surprise, causing him to shrink back a bit. I count things. H.M., I guess so. I counted about that many too. Among them were around 74 rank 3 gremlins. Those things aren't nearly as easy to kill, so good job. Honestly, I'm surprised you all are alive. The reason I said to be back before darkness fell was because of the very situation you encountered. To see in the dark, you would need to light up your area, and the gremlins flock to the light even from far away. They follow the cries of their brethren as well. Plus, since they would then be in a group, they become exceptionally hostile. Nighttime in this dungeon is absolutely the most dangerous time to be out. But you all survived despite pulling in dam near the entire dungeon. Truly, you impress me. Hearing the teaser, the group was surprised once more. All except Dirk, who knew exactly how much of what he killed. During the retreat, he had needed to exert more energy to handle the rank threes quickly. Luckily the gremlins weren't inherently difficult to kill, otherwise things would be different. As for them being lucky to be alive, they truly were. It wasn't hard to know that they made a huge mistake in being out too long. Dirk doubted that they would be able to survive such mistakes in harder dungeons, so he made a note to collect more information next time. Hearing the number of gremlins they killed, Alec felt the weight of the bag once more. It was surprisingly heavy, and considering the fact that it was filled with magic crystals and eyeballs, that meant there was truly a lot inside. However, he thought for a bit before walking up to Dirk and stuffing the bag in his hands. This is yours. There are five of us, so I assume we'll split it evenly. There wouldn't be five of us if it weren't for you. The money you get from it is yours. Besides, if we go purely by kills, most of it is yours anyway. Alec chuckled. Dirk looked at the bag before nodding. He had never really needed to buy anything for himself, but it was nice to actually earn something from his own effort. The group smiled, and the teacher smiled at them with a knowing expression. After a bit more conversation, the teacher sent the group to the bathing room where their armor was washed. After, he began rounding up the students and having them pack. Everyone was eager as they broke down their tents and bagged their items. In about an hour, every student was outside the haven pointed back to the dungeon entrance. Ah! Fresh air! I don't want to come back here ever again. Thankfully we at least got loot. I wonder how much these crystals will go for. As they exited the dungeon, all the students sighed in relief. They were all still covered in grime and smelled, but none of them cared as they embraced the fresh air and bright sun. All right. Follow me to the association, and we'll sell your loot. Yes. The teacher waved all the eager students over. They walked down a couple streets before arriving at a large stone building. They all piled inside and were greeted with a large restaurant and reception area. The teacher walked ahead and let the receptionist know what they wanted to do. Money was quickly prepared, as were boxes for items. All right, how about we let Alec's group go first? Calling them up, the students watched as Alec walked over in front with his group. Jackson, who was still holding bags, put the bags full of eyeballs and magic crystals on the counter. Clang! The bag slammed with rocky weight. A pile of magic crystals fell out. Nearly all the crystals swirled with earth mana while some held their mana. They were all about as big as a marble, and the receptionist looked at a few. Grade 2 crystals, red gremlin eyes, and, are these rank 3 gremlin eyes? 
Impressive. The receptionist nodded as she started counting out the crystals. She poured out the bag in a box, and the crystals rolled out like a flood. A panel on the box suddenly lit up with a couple runes, the lady translating it quickly before speaking. 793 grade 2 crystals, 74 grade 3 crystals, 1586 red eyes, and 148 black eyes. With a rate of 15 silver for the grade 2 crystals, 370 silver for the grade 3 crystals, 6 silver for the red eyes, and 150 silver for the black eyes, we come out with a grand total of 70 gold and 800 silver. Saying that, the receptionist grabbed 70 gold coins and 800 silver ones. The gold coins were large, while the silver ones were like tokens. After laying out all the money, she piled it into a sack with the sweet clangs of precious metal. Pushing forward the bag, she grabbed the box full of eyes and crystals, bringing it into a back room. Is this a lot? Dirk asked as Alec grabbed the bag. From what Dirk learned, this world worked on a system of coins that were issued by each empire. The Horizon Empire issued their own standard coins in the forms of silver as the lowest value, gold as the middle, and crystal as the highest value. It was 1,000 silver for a gold, and 1,000 gold for a crystal. Dirk had never spent any money on his own though, so he wasn't sure how much 70 gold would get him. This was basically his first time even seeing it personally. Alec pondered how to answer his question for a second. To our parents, 70 gold is nothing. A Marquis can easily handle tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of crystal currency. However, if we were normal kids at our levels, then 70 gold would be decent. It'll handle living expenses and food for a good while. Though if you ever wanted to get a weapon repaired or buy armor, you'd be forking out much more than 70 gold. There isn't much that costs silver, and everything that does is more aimed toward ordinary people like clothes, manless food, and other basic items. So is 70 gold a lot? For you, not really. I see. Dirk nodded at the useful explanation. It seemed like he would need a lot more money if he wanted to maintain a top-notch lifestyle like the one his parents afforded him. He also realized how much money his parents had access to. How much did his mother spend on his armor? Dirk thought about asking her. After getting their money, the group gave Dirk 62 gold while everyone else took two. The rest of the students then went up, pouring out their own loot. Unfortunately, there was a pitiful amount of crystals and eyes compared to Dirk's group. None of the groups gained more than a couple gold as it didn't look like any of them killed the rank 3 gremlins which gave the most money. Finally, when they were all done, the teacher led them to the outer area of the town. There, several carriages were waiting to take them back to the academy, concluding their two-day dungeon dive. Ava was excited as she pulled Dirk into the carriage, eager to go back to a nice house. He rolled his eyes, wondering how she would fare against a few week long dungeon dive. Home at last. All right, I'm gonna bathe. Ava cried out as they walked into Dirk's house. On the way, she had stopped by her dorm to grab fresh clothes. Now, she was heading up to the bathroom to wash up. Although they had taken a dip in water after their night battle, it didn't do much to wash them. She planned on cleaning up thoroughly. Dirk smiled a bit as she ran up the stairs. Since it was already past midday, he decided to cook up a meal. However, it wasn't until an hour later when Ava walked down with damp hair. The first thing she saw was Dirk casually clearing off plates of food. It was one of their normal meals for both of them, but he had eaten most of it. She gawked. Ah, why did you eat it all? Next time don't take an hour in the bath. I cooked this half an hour ago. It was gonna get cold. So what? I only fell asleep for a bit. You couldn't wait? Fell asleep? I I was tired. Ava reddened as she scratched her head. Dirk looked at her with a dumb face before shaking his head. How does one fall asleep in the bathtub? Whatever. We always eat together, so don't take so long next time. Or you can tell me and we can eat before I go wash up. You seemed pretty eager to wash. I was covered in gremlin blood. Do you know how disgusting that is? 
I was covered in it too. You're not normal. Ugh, whatever. I'll finish the rest. Sulking, Ava sat down and ate the rest of the food on the table. Dirk grinned before heading up to wash himself, flicking Ava's forehead on the way past her. Chapter 46, Jobs After arriving back at school, all the second-year students who went on the dungeon dive went back to their normal school schedule. As students going on dungeon dives was a normal occurrence, the teachers were adept at handling their return and getting them up to speed. Naturally, a consequence of diving was needing to catch up on their studies, but as they came to find out, that wasn't as difficult as they imagined. Garrel, Dirk's teacher, described it this way. When you go dungeon diving, you tend to learn about magic in a more applied sense. This can greatly accelerate your learning speed, making up for you losing out on school time. You'll find that spells become easier to learn and form. And as you come to advance in tier, these classes will do less and less for you. You'll only need to attain the runes for a spell, and all the theory will be developed in your own mind. High-level magicians often carve out their own way of handling magic, so they don't study, instead researching. Many of the upperclassmen refrain from taking classes at all anymore as they focus on other matters. Of course, the academy finds no problem with this. Magic is different for everyone, so as long as you make progress, it doesn't matter much how you do so. Dirk listened to his teacher with surprise. He figured that learning magic was like learning other subjects. Keeping up with study should help him out and promote his advancements. But the reality didn't seem to be that way. And as he went through his other classes, he found what Geralt said to be true. He found himself more easily understanding the new spells that were being taught. He could form runes with fewer tries as knowledge about how the magic worked simply came to him easier. Thinking about it, Dirk came to the conclusion that using magic on instinct helped the mind with more completely understanding the spell. He remembered how he was able to cast his spells during the night battle with skill. The circles appeared almost non-existent, and he found himself directly controlling the mana and its function. This was silent casting, and it could only be performed by those who had a high understanding of their spell, the runes that formed it, and the element they controlled. Now, Dirk was seeing the value of dungeon diving and being able to use magic without restraint. It simply wasn't possible to go far strictly by researching or studying. One had to apply their knowledge and actually use magic, forming their own unique understanding of the element. Dungeon diving was the perfect way to not only do this, but to make money in the process. Knowing that, Dirk wasn't so hesitant about diving anymore. However, there were some subjects that couldn't be learned without studying. Two of these were Dirk's forging and enchanting classes. Dirk was forced to stress his mind in an attempt to grasp all the things he missed in the two days he was gone. Luckily he was able to catch up in a timely manner, but he learned that it would be difficult to learn these subjects if you were always out for long periods of time. Enchanting and forging required a lot of study as well as practice. He would need to put in many hours, and he couldn't do that if he were gone. So he began to plan his schedule. While he was in his fire class, it was Alec who came to him with a piece of information. The academy put out dungeon jobs for all of the students to complete. These jobs required groups to go out to specific dungeons and attain specific items, usually magic crystals and loot from a monster's body. There were also jobs that sent one to other cities, towns, or plots of land to complete requests. Some cities requested students to go and help kill monsters that were growing out of control, and sometimes there was a town that was requesting someone powerful to kill off a powerful beast. Jobs paid according to their difficulty and the time it took to complete. Hearing this, Dirk had many ideas pop into his mind. With a list of jobs in front of him, he wouldn't need to spend much time finding a reason to go out and fight. The jobs provided a quick and direct goal with rewards. It was perfect for him. This way, he could plan out his schedule. That evening, he grabbed Ava and went to go look at all the jobs. The jobs were posted all over some walls in a building built just for the purpose of displaying jobs and turning in loot. Apparently the place was jointly run by the Dungeon Association and the Academy. The two entered the building where dozens of other older students were wandering around. 
most were looking across the walls. Each wall was divided between tier, so there were tier 2 jobs, tier 3 jobs, tier 4, tier 5, and tier 6. Dirk and Ava decided to look at the tier 2 jobs first. Lesser Dungeon Dive, collect 80 grade 2 fire mana crystals from the Dune Worms. 35 Gold. Lesser Dungeon Dive, Collect 150 primary claws from the three clawed forest monkeys. Point fifty three gold. They read through various jobs. All of them were straightforward, but Ava was shocked at how little money they gave. On their recent dive, they came out with 70 gold, and that was their first dive ever. These barely gave half that, and they would likely take longer. However, these were only the tier 2 jobs. They were likely rather easy, like going out and getting red eyes from the gremlins. The two quickly shifted over to the tier 3 jobs where it was quite a bit more crowded. Lesser Dungeon Dive, collect 60 grade 3 water mana crystals from the water spitting forest mantis. 130 gold. Field Job, town requesting help to subjugate rank 3 wolf infestation. Estimated 150 plus wolves. At least two thirds must be killed to cull population to tolerable levels. 210 gold. Must meet minimum requirements to accept. Seeing these jobs, the two were happier. They ranged from 100 gold as the lowest to a few hundred in the higher end. However, the challenge was correspondingly higher. Seeing some of the jobs, Dirk and Ava weren't sure if they could complete them. But that wasn't too much of a concern for them. Both of them only wanted a reason to go out and fight while making some money. They looked around and found some jobs that would be a good challenge for them. However, this brought them to another problem. Who would be in their group? Technically there weren't any group requirements now that they were on their own. But more people would ensure their safety. If they were going to take on a greater challenge than the Gremlin Dungeon, they knew just the two of them might not be safe enough. Plus, they weren't sure how they would handle things like transportation and supplies. This was their first time, so they needed to learn how to take care of themselves. Right as they were pondering though, a familiar face approached. Hey guys. Looking at the jobs too? Alec walked over with a bright smile. Ava greeted him back before noticing the paper in his hands. What's that? It's a job. Tier 3 Dungeon Dive for 140 Grade 3 Fire Mana Crystals. It's paying 170 gold. Good difficulty, good money. In fact, I was just thinking about you too. How would you like to join me on this job? Really? Of course. I can't think of anyone more reliable than you two. The only problem is time, but I'm sure we can work that out. What do you think? Before answering for them, Ava turned to Dirk. Dirk looked at Alec who returned his gaze. The two seemed to stare each other down before Dirk nodded. Let's do it. Great. Now, I think I have some other people in mind to take with us, but since we're a party again, I'll ask for input. Do you guys think we should take five people with us? Is there a reason we shouldn't? I can think of a couple. Come, let's sit. Responding to Ava, Alec waved them over to an empty table. The three sat down across from each other. There are a few pros and cons to taking bigger groups. Let's start with the pros safety is an obvious one. More people means more combat power. We'll also have someone who can be a bag handler like Jackson was, freeing others up for combat. Then there's knowledge and skill diversity. Different people know different things bringing more versatility to the group. However, these are about the extent of the pros. There are several cons. The most obvious con is the fact that we split the money between the group, so more people means less money for each. Then there are travel expenses. More people require more money to take care of, so it's less efficient. Then, the least obvious one is trust. More people can bring on more uncertainty, especially if they are strangers. Lack of trust is dangerous while in a dangerous environment. If we bring fewer people, like just us three, then we'll have to compensate for the lack of extra safety with our skill. But that will afford us tactics we may not normally be able to use. Few people can maneuver dungeons better, 
and I don't believe we have any problems with trust, so we know that we have each other's backs. Now if we brought five, then we would be a larger unit, and we've already seen how that works. Hmm. Ava and Dirk listened to him intently, sorting out the best setup in their mind. Everything he said was correct, and Alec seemed especially knowledgeable about this stuff. Dirk didn't find any flaws in his logic either. Different numbers had different pros and cons. When he was back on Earth, it was the same way. What do you think we should do? After a while, Ava asked Alec. I think we should take five, in the same way we did in this last dungeon dive. This is a tier three job, and because we don't have tons of experience, I think we should play it safer. I agree. After giving his opinion, Dirk spoke up and concurred. Ava was surprised at his prompt agreement for a bit before agreeing as well. I also think that's a good idea. So, since we're taking five, who do you think should be our other two? Harmit? I can see if he's available. As for our fifth, I don't think I'll be asking Jackson. He was a cool guy, but we need competence. I'll try and find someone who is strong but okay with carrying bags. We also need intelligence on the dungeon. The types of monsters, the environment, and any unique aspects like with the Gremlin dungeon. Of course. This place will tell us the location, how to get there, the monsters, and some other basic information about the dungeon that will help us with packing our bags. As for the unique pieces of information, I've heard that that is usually found at the town next to the dungeon. We ask people for it, oftentimes for a little money in exchange. Hmm. Hearing this, Dirk nodded, pleased. He didn't want to run into any unexpected changes like with the Gremlin dungeon. If he were going to deal with anything difficult, he at least wanted to be prepared. After finalizing more details, Dirk and Ava split away from Alec who went out to recruit. Apparently, the schedule for the job was determined by the latest date to complete it. For dungeon dives like theirs, upon taking the job, it was reserved for two weeks, after which it would be put back up for grabs for another group to have a go at it. That meant that Dirk's group had to complete the job preferably within those two weeks, otherwise another group would come in and could complete it before them, especially if they took too long. Two days later, Alec found Dirk and explained to him that he had found people. The first wasn't Harmit as he had expected, but another water mage. Then there was the second who not only trained Anima, but was an air mage. Alec gave Dirk his house address, telling him to come with Ava after all his classes ended in the evening. When the time came, Dirk went with Ava and found the house. It wasn't that far from where he lived, and it looked like Alec lived the same lifestyle as himself. The two knocked on the door, and Alec promptly answered. Come in. Here, let me introduce you. This is Kazma, the water mage, and this is Garrett, the anima trainer and air mage. Both of them are actually childhood friends. Good to meet you. Kazma and Garrett, one girl and one boy. Ava and Dirk greeted them before the five sat down at a table. Alec went on to explain their next steps. All right. With this group, we are covering all the attributes. We have two water mages, two fire mages, an earth mage, an air mage, and plenty of combat power. I don't believe there are any situations that at least one of us couldn't handle. Now, I accepted the job two days ago, which means we have about 12 days before it's reposted. However, we actually have around 20 days before needing to complete it. Reposted jobs are marked, and people won't usually take them since the group could just be running a little late. It would be unfortunate if you took a reposted job and the original group completed it right as you left. So, unless the job is a couple of weeks overdue, nobody will take it. Now, I was thinking we could plan our leave four days from now at the end of the week. That will give us time to buy supplies and settle our classes. As for travel, I've already found a place where we can find a driver. The drive to the dungeon will take about two days, giving us at least two weeks to safely complete the job. As for expenses, just the drive will cost two gold per day per person. So each of us will pay four gold to ride. Then there are the supplies. We will need many basic necessities, primarily food. Water can be obtained from our water mages. 
If we plan on being in the dungeon for more than two days, then we need other things like a tub to bathe and wash clothes and armor in. I've got a list here. Alex spoke as he laid everything out, eventually handing them each a sheet of paper. On it was a long list of items that they may want to take. There were basic things like the tent, blankets, and food, but also things like cooking supplies and storage for loot. It seemed like Alec had done a lot of research over the past couple days. The group talked about what they should take. If they wanted extra things like cooking supplies, then they needed to pitch in and buy it together. But then came the problem of who would take it when they split after the job. Thankfully, it at least didn't seem like anyone struggled with money. Both Kazma and Garrett were Viscounts, so they got allowances. Ava, Alec, and Dirk also didn't need to worry about anything, though Dirk wasn't sure what he would do if he spent the 60 gold he got from the recent dungeon dive. Like that, the five discussed plans all the way into the night. This served to settle logistics as well as getting to know each other, so everyone was fine with it. Dirk and Ava eventually left with a list of things to do. The next day, Ava decided to go out and buy their things since Dirk was in school until late. In the morning, he was going to hand her the money he got from the dive, but she refused it all, leaving with a promise that he would have everything he needed. He couldn't stop her from rushing out of the house, leaving him helpless. With that, he went to school. The magic classes went by as they always did with Dirk being introduced to more advanced spells. He had also completely documented the book, so if he wanted he could study during the trip. This was actually recommended to most students. They could make notes and take them to study. Then, he got to his forging class. Today, the dwarven teacher had them on the anvil using some basic iron. There was also a wall of furnaces that blazed with fire, heating up the room to excessive heats. However, none of the students were sweating. This was due to the fact that all of them had the fire attribute. One thing Dirk learned was that if one had an attribute like fire, then they would have inherent resistances to fire. The fire mana within their bodies protected them, making them basically immune to fire that didn't surpass their tier. This meant that basic fire, unless they lowered their defenses intentionally, couldn't burn them. Naturally this meant that heat didn't affect them much either. All right. Today we're going to be forging the beginnings of a knife. This involves making the design, cutting the metal, and shaping it. Over the next few days, we will be tempering it and sharpening it. The final steps will be adding the handle. Now, grab a sheet of paper and look at the design that I've made for you all. For now, I won't have you design anything but simply follow the design. Chapter 47, Challenge the class took a look at the design in front of them. On the paper was the simple outline of a knife. It wasn't very long or short, looking like an extremely basic knife. The students saw the curves and shape of the handle, imprinting it into their minds. After they had looked at it for a bit, the dwarf had them grab the metal ingot with some tongs and put it in their own furnace. The students collided as they all headed to the same wall, sticking their ingots into the stacks of furnaces. They then waited as the ingots turned red hot. When the dwarf gave the word, they all rushed to grab theirs and quickly bring it back to their anvil. Then, they got to shaping it. Dirk grabbed his heavy hammer, his mind coming up with how he would shape the ingot. He thought quickly as the hammer came down, producing a clang. All the students were quick to pound their ingot, filling the room with rings. Dirk hit the metal on the corners and sides flattening the thick ingot and guiding one end of the metal to a knife point. This was all stuff he had been taught over the days of learning from his teacher, so he now just needed to follow the steps. After a while though, the metal cooled, forcing him to go and reheat the metal before continuing to shape. This process repeated itself a few times as Dirk sought the best shape. Finally, after the fourth round, he had his shape. The knife cooled as he gazed at the long, pointed piece of metal. It wasn't at all sharp, the edges being flat, but that would come later. The hardest part had been the handle, but using a square hammer in the different parts of the anvil, he was able to make a flat and straight handle. Good. Four rounds? For your first time, not bad at all. Now if only these other barbarians could match you. The dwarf scoffed after congratulating Dirk, 
making the faces of the other students fall. They were all still pounding their metal, many slowly shaping their metal correctly. Most of them refrained from using too much power so as to avoid mistakes, but this made the process go slower. Slow shaping meant more cooling and more reheating, so the time added up. Hearing the dwarf though, they all strengthened their grips and slammed down harder, seeking to move quicker. All right. Dirk right? Now you need to temper the metal a bit. This is the longest part, but you should be done by the end of class. First, you want to heat the metal while setting the furnace to this level. Then you just let it cool off in the air until it's warm. You then heat it right back up, letting it cool down once more. You should do this three times, after which you'll be done for the day. Now get on it. Understood. Dirk nodded before doing as instructed. He placed the knife into the furnace and set it to a certain level, letting the furnace heat it up. After a while, the dwarf told him when to take it out. Dirk noted down the time and what it looked like as he pulled it out for future reference. He then let it cool, also stopping when the dwarf told him to and putting it back into the furnace. With that, Dirk had his reference points. He spent the rest of class waiting as the metal heated and cooled three times over. He ended up finishing a little while before class ended, leaving his knife with the teacher for the next day. His next class was his enchanting class. Like his forging class, he had been learning more theory knowledge. Now though, it was time for him to get some practice. Upon walking into class, Dirk noticed a piece of animal leather on his table. The teacher quickly gave them instructions. Today you will be enchanting this leather. It won't be anything elaborate. You merely need to inlay a single rune. Upon successfully laying a rune, you will be capable of activating it upon running an element through it. You'll see this in the form of a glow. Now, since enchanters deal strictly with their own attributes, you each will have a different rune according to what your attributes are. Here is a rune for each of the elements. Pick the one you feel the most comfortable with. The teacher put up six runes on the wall, one for each element. The students looked and thought about their attributes. Dirk didn't think too much before picking the earth element rune and looking at his piece of leather. The teacher didn't explain as they had already gone over all the fundamentals. From what Dirk learned, enchanting was basically engraving a spell onto an item using the element. The hardest part about enchanting, which is what made it such a rare occupation, was the process of inlaying the element into the item. This required a unique understanding of the element and how it interacted with materials. Most people simply couldn't figure out how to do so, while few could. These few became enchanters. With this knowledge in mind, Dirk saw this as something of a test, as did the other students. If they couldn't do this, then they may not have the talent to be an enchanter. There was only so much you could learn about a subject before you needed to apply the knowledge. Well, this was their application. Dirk stroked the leather with his hand, feeling the rough texture. The leather was blue, making him wonder where it came from. That didn't matter though as he called upon the earth element within his mana heart, passing it into the leather into the shape of the rune. This is where the problem came. The element formed within the leather like a letter on a page. But that was it. The element didn't bind to the material or even interact with it. To interact with the physical world, mana needed to be transformed through the use of runes, conjuring magical phenomena in a process called magic. But for enchanting, one needed to implant the rune itself onto the material. To do this, the teacher said that one simply needed to feel the interaction between the material and the mana. When one felt the interaction, they could learn how to bind the two. But as Dirk formed the rune within the material, he felt nothing. He frowned as he moved the mana around, searching for anything. The other students were the same. It didn't look like anybody felt anything as they injected mana into the leather and played around with it. This went on for an entire hour. During this time, it was as if nobody made any progress. Even Dirk was still stuck. He did all kinds of tricks with his mana, but nothing came to him. He frowned as the end of class approached. The students felt their heart drop as the teacher stood in front of them all. Doesn't look like any of you succeeded. But fret not. You have until the end of the week to succeed. 
However, none of you are allowed to take this leather with you. In order to pass, you must enchant the rune onto this specific piece of leather. However, you are allowed to take home and practice on another piece of leather if you wish. I have one right here. The teacher grabbed a stack of brown leather, of which Dirk quickly took one. The leather seemed cheaper than the blue leather, but he didn't care. With that, the goal was given, and class ended. All the students stayed to practice more, so as always Dirk was the first one who immediately left. He walked home while staring holes into the leather, practicing as he walked. When he walked into the house though, his attention was pulled away. Ava was there sorting various items. Most of it looked like the supplies for their next trip. Hey! Come take a look at everything. I didn't get things like fire starters since you can cast your own fire. Did you know that they have a shop for all this stuff here in the academy? Made things easy for me. She spoke as Dirk went and took a look at the pile of supplies. The first bag they were given before their first dungeon dive was gone, replaced by a higher quality bag. This bag could fit all the basic items like the tent and blankets easier, and it would make it more convenient for whoever was carrying it. There was also a restocking of some food and medical supplies. Ava had bought some additional water bags as well as a big sack for loot. Finally, there was a large compartment in the bag for extra clothes, something they would need a lot of. Looks good. Dirk nodded as he went through everything. Technically, the only thing he truly needed was food and water. They could survive with just that, so he didn't stress about making sure they had all the other luxuries. Oh hey, look at this. I found this there and thought we should try it. It's called a frost crystal, and it's supposed to cool down your body within your armor. I tried it out earlier and it felt amazing. Here, try. Saying that, Ava picked up a crystal and brought it over to Dirk. The crystal was a flat disc that looked like ice. Dirk didn't stop Ava as she pulled up his shirt and placed the disc against his chest, activating it. The next moment, Dirk felt a cooling sensation spread through his body. He was surprised by how amazing it felt, but before long, it got a little too cold for his liking. Ava pulled it off when he said to. So? An interesting item. But I don't think I'll need it. Really? But what if we go into a hot area? Alex said the dungeon we're going to will be like that. Fire mages have inherent resistances to heat. I won't even sweat, and fire can't burn me unless the mana within it is strong enough. So I don't really need cooling. Oh, all right then. I'll just keep it for myself then. Water mages have some resistance to heat, but not much. I'll use it to be comfortable. How long does it last? One of these will last a day of usage before running out. Then it just becomes a fancy rock that they buy back for next to nothing. It's surprisingly expensive for a one-day item, but it sure does work. How much? Five gold. So if you wanted to use that throughout our dive, you would be buying around fifteen. That's seventy-five gold. I know. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it is. It's more than we're going to be earning after splitting the reward. Sheesh, getting money is hard. Ava sighed while Dirk nodded. That's why we get more powerful. Now, how much did you spend on all this stuff? Don't worry about that. Tell me. Only if you promise not to pay me back. Fine. Total was about 95 gold. Here's 60. No. The two went back and forth after Dirk tried to shove money in Ava's hand, her eventually succeeding in refusing the money. After bickering a bit, they both went on to train for a while. That night, Ava left for her dorm to sleep. Upon arriving, she settled her friends before hopping into bed. While doing so though, a gold coin fell out of her pocket. She picked it up and looked at it. A coin? Lucky find. I thought I had spent it all. With a naive smile, she went to sleep. The next day, Dirk was back to forging his knife. Upon arriving to class, he immediately went to work which included the forming. The class had a few grinders, and since Dirk was the first to get to this step, he got to use one. 
he went up to the grinder, the dwarven teacher quickly coming to his side in order to assist his best student. He showed him the angles for the best sharpening and the best way to get the shape he wanted. Dirk then got to work, using ultra-precise adjustments to get the best angles. He even employed his AI to measure the knife out, ensuring he made it perfectly symmetrical. This went on for a while as all the other students moved on to tempering their knife. Dirk was totally immersed in the knife he was forming. He didn't even realize how seriously he was taking this. Then, about halfway through class, Dirk finished. He pulled the knife away from the grinder, his AI scanning every inch. The result came out perfect. The knife matched the design perfectly except for a slight size difference, but that didn't matter much. The shape, curve, and angle the blade was sharpened at were perfect. The only thing missing was the more precise sharpening treatment, but that would come later when he got his hands on a whetstone. The dwarf came over as Dirk admired his knife. Upon taking a look, he was stunned. The dwarf reached out to grab the knife, but Dirk's reflexes came in and his hand zipped out of the way. The dwarf huffed. Gimme that. I want to see how you did. All right. Dirk handed him the knife, surprisingly unwilling to give it away. The dwarf snatched it before looking at every inch, feeling the curve and body of the blade as if it were his lover. It was a few minutes later when he finally pulled his eyeballs off of it, speaking with excitement. Amazing. Truly a masterpiece. The shape, the detail, the gradual curves, the angle. Perfect. You, my student, have an amazing eye and an even better hand. Have you done this before? Be honest with me. The dwarf got close to Dirk as he asked. Dirk shook his head, leaning back to avoid the large nose coming for him. The dwarf also pulled back seeing his answer, stroking his burnt beard. I see. Then I ask you, please don't let your talent go to waste. Here, go ahead and finish up your knife. Heat it and then cool it in the oil. That will harden it, finalizing the metal. Then you can sharpen it, and finally polish it. I wish to see how well you can sharpen it. With that, the teacher walked away. Dirk nodded as he headed to a furnace under the burning eyes of his classmates. He set his knife inside before grabbing a bucket of oil toward the side. After getting it to the right heat, he quickly pulled the knife out and dunked it into the oil. The oil sizzled at the metal rapidly cooled. Once it was cold, he pulled it out and wiped it off. The metal was now hardened. Then came the sharpening. The teacher brought Dirk a whetstone personally, having him sit down and start. Dirk quickly went to work dripping some water onto the stone before angling his knife on it. He then slid it up the stone, leaving a metallic streak behind. He repeated this process as the edge became sharper. His movements were precise and steady. He always retained the angle of the knife as he moved, and he didn't sharpen any part of the edge more than the other. He was a natural, but when it came to this, that wasn't surprising. Dirk had sharpened many knives back on earth, so he very well knew how. Although it was mostly with a sharpener, he was no stranger to the whetstone. He had even sharpened things with rocks, though that was mostly out of boredom. Now, his skills were on display. Dirk maintained absolute control over his body, making sure every movement was to his liking. The teacher watched in awe as Dirk seemed to be the most natural blacksmith in the world. Other students also came over to watch the surprisingly enrapturing scene. Finally, he finished. He held up the knife, and for the first time in a while, he smiled. He looked upon his creation with excitement. He received a surprising sense of fulfillment for making this, and he wished to immediately make another. Good. Good. You see that everyone? That's how you sharpen a knife. Now how about you all hurry up so you can get started? The dwarf yelled at everyone, dispersing them. He then brought Dirk over to polish it, something that took little time compared to the other steps. By the end of class, he was finished. Dirk topped off the knife by tying a rope around the metal handle for grip. After knotting it off, he smiled again. The knife could now be used. There you are, Dirk. You've passed the assignment with flying colors. Go ahead and take it with you. 
usually I would just collect all the knives and melt them back down since they're usually pieces of shit, but this one isn't. It's too good to melt, so take care of it. It's your first creation, and a damn good one at that. It'll become a memoir in the future. The dwarf smiled, patting Dirk on the back. He nodded as the thought of forging more appeared in his mind. If it were up to him, he would continue forging until the end of the night. But class was ending, and he had another challenge ahead of him. Leaving class, Dirk pulled out his practice piece of leather. He still had yet to enchant the rune onto it, and he still wasn't any farther along. After arriving to class, the teacher didn't even speak a word. The students didn't either as they all went to work on enchanting. Nobody wished to waste time. Dirk tried everything once more. He concentrated earth and mana in the form of the rune before searching around for the feeling the teacher described. He said the person would feel some kind of contact between the mana and the material, and all they had to do was find that feeling before binding the mana. This would create a mana circuit where mana could be streamed through, activating the rune. The idea was the same as a spell. A spell was a series of runes and mana circuits drawn in the air. It was self-sustained by a circulatory path of mana, able to be generated and dispersed at will. However, an enchantment was permanent. It would consume mana and plant it onto a material. At any time afterward, you could send the appropriate mana through the circuit and it would activate. The reason this was significant was because it required no computational effort by the user. They simply sent the mana in, and the enchantment did the rest. It was basically a pre-made or consumable spell. The only restriction was the amount of mana it took to activate and the type of mana it took. Anybody could activate the enchantment should they meet those requirements. Naturally, because enchantments could be used by anyone, they were the most popular item on the market. A dungeon diver could grab an enchanted scroll and use it in a time of crisis to quickly save their life. A magically incompetent mage could get one and use it despite it being impossible for him to cast the very spell that was enchanted on the scroll. It enabled the weak, but also enhanced the strong. It could be used for nearly any purpose. However, enchanters were exceptionally rare, so their products were likewise exceptionally pricey. Despite all that, Dirk wasn't worried. He didn't care about the potential money-making ability, which every other enchanter in training did. The only thing he cared about was the fact that he couldn't do it. At least, not right now. A difficult challenge was thrown at him, and it lit a fire within him that compelled him to complete it. With his mind set on something, it would take the entire damn world to keep him from completing it. Chapter 48 Anger Dirk went through his enchanting class with the burning determination to enchant the rune onto the leather. But for half the class, nothing came to him. After a while, frustration began to come over him. Feeling this, he forced himself to take a step back. It wasn't often he felt frustration, so it spoke of how determined he was. Dirk stared holes into the leather, envisioning in his mind the different ways to go about enchanting. It was this very situation that was the reason why there were so few enchanters. There was no set technique to enchant. One simply had to find the feeling that indicated the interaction between mana and material. Most couldn't find this feeling, and only a few could. It was considered a gift to be able to catch this feeling. Dirk didn't know if he had this gift. Nobody did until they found it. So until they found the feeling, they were basically searching blind. But Dirk didn't like searching blind. He thought about the very concept of enchanting and the reasons he couldn't touch the mana to the leather. This didn't give him many ideas though. Luckily, a light bulb lit up the next second. Dirk looked to the front of the class where a piece of paper was plastered. It showed the runes for each of the elements. Technically, one could enchant using any element, and Dirk had three at his disposal. Since the earth element wasn't working out for him, he decided he would move on to fire. Picking up the leather, Dirk pulled the fire mana out of him and formed it into the rune. However, the process was quite a bit more difficult than using earth mana. Dirk always used earth mana since he was forming his first mana heart using earth mana. His heart was almost fully formed, and it made using earth spells much easier than with his other attributes. 
he also had a much larger earth mana pool while his fire and dark mana pools were much smaller. Basically, earth was his best element. But it wasn't working for enchanting, so he had to try different avenues. Luckily, a bit more difficulty didn't mean he had any trouble with it. Dirk formed the rune and tried to make contact with the leather. Since fire was inherently more chaotic, it was harder to get under control. Using his supreme willpower though, he was able to solidify it, bending it how he wished. But even then, nothing came. He held the mana in place for twenty straight minutes, going through all the different tricks like with his earth mana. He solidified the rune, pumped mana through it, waved it around, spun it around, and even went on to activate it a bit. The only result he got was lighting the practice piece of leather on fire, forcing him to ask the teacher for another piece before going back to work. In the end, Dirk didn't get anywhere. By the end of class, he was standing in front of his desk with his head hung down, glaring at the leather. Every other student was as well, and nobody, not even Dirk, felt like leaving. So he didn't. Dirk stayed another half an hour, thinking. However, something snapped him out of his reverie. All of a sudden, one of the students shouted in glee as a rune formed on their practice piece of leather. Dirk's head snapped over, as did all the others. The teacher quickly stood up and walked over. Hmm. Taking the leather from the excited student, the teacher examined it front and back. He then nodded, causing the student to smile even wider. Good job. Now. Do the same thing on the official piece of leather, and you will have passed the test. That should be easy though. You've at least shown that you have the gift of enchanting. Keep up the good work. Yes sir. The student almost shouted as he picked up the blue piece of leather. Everyone watched as he then enchanted the rune onto it. Especially Dirk. He went so far as to record the scene with his AI while watching his mana sense and what he saw surprised him. Dirk saw the boy's mana weave into the leather before shaking a bit and turning solid as a rock. The mana was bound to the material. Seeing this, Dirk suddenly felt his mind light up, and he instantly turned back to his own leather. Resonance. He felt enlightened. The mana shaking looked exactly the same as when he resonated his own anima in his anima resonance destruction technique. Thinking that far, Dirk went to stream his mana into his piece of leather. However, before he did, he decided to use his dark mana. In his dark class, his teacher Garrel always had his students control streams of dark mana and make large runes with them, enhancing their control over it. If it was for this, he felt like it would be the good choice. So he streamed it in. The dark mana flowed into the leather like a snake as it took on the shape of the dark rune. Then, Dirk applied the same logic as with his anima to resonate the mana. He applied a frequency to the mana. Unfortunately, it didn't work. However, Dirk was able to feel something ever so slight. He could feel the mana make contact with the leather, and it filled him with joy. He kept resonating at the same frequency just to grasp this feeling that he had been seeking for hours. Then, he went on to search for the frequency that the leather resonated at. If he could match the frequencies of the mana and leather, he could bind it. Thinking that far, he realized that this worked in exactly the opposite way as his destruction technique. When anima resonated with material, it destroyed it. When mana resonated with material, it bound to it, enhancing it. He felt even more enlightened, but this brought him to another question. Why wouldn't the people of this world understand this? If he were right, then would that mean he was the first to discover this? That was highly unlikely. It was impossible that nobody had attempted to study enchanting and its fundamentals. But then, why did the teacher make it so difficult to understand? Why did he only say to search for a feeling and not describe the system of resonance that it worked off of? Could it be that he didn't understand, or that he had something to hide? Dirk was skeptical, but he decided that he shouldn't worry about it for now. He focused his attention on first completing his test. He searched through many frequencies, trying to grasp the exact one that would bind the dark mana to the leather. However, coming to this point, he found himself with another difficulty. The dark mana didn't want to listen to him. 
this was a problem that Dirk always had in his classes with Geralt. It was like Dark Mana had a mind of its own and would actively resist Dirk's commands and control. It took him forcing its compliance with sheer willpower to get it to work. And as he used it with enchanting, it was no different. It was a good thing that he had lots of practice, otherwise it might be impossible for him to work with Dark Mana. But it did make the process take longer. After another hour, Dirk still hadn't found the frequency, but he felt himself getting closer. He also tried using a different element, but he found that if he used a different element, then he would have to find a different frequency. For the sake of a quicker success, he decided to stick with dark mana that he made progress with. At this point though, he decided to go home since it had already been almost two hours since class ended. Taking the practice piece of leather, he left the class and started walking. Upon opening the door to his home, he found Ava already there. Hey! You're home late. How was school? Rather good, actually. What's that? Leather. Dirk spoke and smiled. I've figured out enchanting. I'm thinking I can complete my little test by tomorrow. Wait, really? You can actually enchant? That's amazing. Not really. What do you mean? Enchanters are the richest and most highly valued craftsmen in the world. Only those with the gift can enchant, and you actually have it. It's not a gift. There's actually a way to enchant, only they don't seem to tell anyone. All I know is that it's not a gift. Anyway, I haven't actually enchanted a rune yet. But by tomorrow, I should have it figured out. Dirk spoke while rubbing his chin, the excitement in his voice clear. Ava nodded. Interesting. Well good luck. Just remember that we leave in two days. I would make sure that your classes are settled before we leave. Of course. Oh, I also made this knife today. In your forging class? Well, aren't you the talented craftsman? Not really talent, just figure it out. Here. Dirk went on to show Ava the knife. She admired it for a while, tracing its smooth curves and razor-sharp blade. Then she remembered something and walked over to a bag of hers, pulling out a flask and handing it to him. Actually, I also succeeded a bit in alchemy. This is a healing potion, although it's the least potent one an alchemist can make. It'll barely heal a scratch. Really? That's cool. Good job. Dirk praised as he took the flask with a swirling blue liquid in it. Ava let out a breath. Eh, it's nothing. I can't really make better ones anyway. Huh. Why not? Because I don't have the light attribute. Ava scratched her head with a depressed sigh. The good healing potions can only be made by those who can handle the light element since the light element can inherently heal. I only have the water attribute, so mixing potions with ingredients is all I can do. If I had the light attribute, then I could add properties to the potions, enhancing their effects. I had wanted to make better healing potions, but it looks like that might be impossible unless I get high-quality ingredients. Oh. Well, there's no need to get bent out of shape. It's fine that you don't have the light element. Why did you want to make healing potions anyway? Well, that was hopefully how I was going to repay you. She scratched her head again, a bit embarrassed. Dirk just shook his head though. I've told you before, there's no need to repay me. I don't need it. Hey, those healing potions you drink are valuable. They're some of the highest quality potions you can get and cost a few hundred gold each. Those things are basically liquid gold, and you not only gave some to me, but took care of me. I can't give you nothing in return, so I wanted to see if it would be possible for me to make them myself. But, well... Ava drifted off. Dirk shook his head. Look, please don't worry about it. Those potions are from my parents, and they neither asked any questions about the little increase in potion consumption nor require me to pay them back. Even if they did though, I would figure it out. Those potions were my compensation for injuring you. My injuries could have healed naturally. As can my own injuries from my destruction cycles. But I have the luxury of receiving potions from my parents, so I use them as I see fit. 
what I did was within my jurisdiction, so don't worry about it. Dirk spoke a bit sternly, ensuring he got his point across to Ava who couldn't seem to accept it. She was a bit surprised in return though. Back on Earth, Dirk had access to literally billions in resources in the form of weapons and gear. He himself was the result of billions in investment, and he had caused billions in damages throughout his career. Needless to say, Dirk was no stranger to the concept of handling expensive resources. He didn't hesitate in using the things given to him since he had already done so for years. His drinking potions that cost a few hundred gold each didn't even faze him. He was simply using a resource available to him. In that way, he was a bit spoiled and insensitive when it came to money. It was only when he had come to this world and developed relationships with people like his family and Ava that he came to be conscious of what was given and taken. It was why he didn't want Ava to be concerned with paying back something that needn't be. It was also why he used the potions in the most efficient way while recovering from his destruction cycles. He wouldn't hesitate in using the resources, but he also wouldn't be excessive. He wanted Ava to understand this so she wouldn't be concerned with a minor issue. However, he was unaware of how she saw it. Ava went silent, her face looking a bit hurt. The next moment, she snatched back the potion from him. Fine then, I won't worry. And since I'm not worrying about it, we don't need this. Crash. Walking over to the sink, Ava dropped the glass flask. It shattered, the potion spilling down the drain. Dirk's eyebrows raised, a bit stunned. He didn't understand why she would destroy her first successful alchemical potion. He was confused as to why she suddenly flipped a switch. What are you doing? Not worrying about repaying you. This potion was made for that purpose, and since it serves no purpose anymore, it has no value. Why would I want it anymore? Because it was your first alchemical success. So? You think I care about that? Whatever. I'm leaving. Huh? What the hell is going on? Where are you going? To my dorm. What, should I not do that either? Ava shouted at Dirk, causing him to recoil a bit. The next moment though, he suddenly felt a surge of anger as she spun around and grabbed her back. As she walked toward the door, black tendrils extended from Dirk's fingertips. His emotions flared, and his hand twitched. She opened the door, speaking without turning around. I'll see you the day after tomorrow when we have to leave. Slam. She walked out, the door closing behind her with a bang. Dirk stood there in silence as his figure oozed the aura of violence. He gritted his teeth. He didn't know what had gotten into her, but this sudden hostility from her pissed him off. Ha! Ah. With a yell, he clawed at the air. The black tendrils that extended from his fingers turned into claws and launched a salvo of destructive black streaks. They instantly tore at the door that Ava closed, but surprisingly did no harm as a magical barrier lit up with defensive power. The streaks were blocked, leaving behind black mana marks on the magic barrier. Seeing this, Dirk snarled before turning around and walking to the sink. Looking down at the glass fragments, he reached out his hands and scooped them into a pile. The fragments began to disintegrate under the destructive power of the dark tendrils around his fingers. Soon, all the glass had evaporated, though it expended a lot of energy. Dirk didn't care though as he closed his eyes, attempting to rein himself in. Whatever. Deciding that he was too mad to care about his body's odd magical reaction, Dirk walked up the stair to his bedroom, going to bed for the night. The next morning, Dirk got out of bed. His mind was now clearer, though he still wasn't happy. At the very least, he wouldn't have any violent outbursts. His face bore a frown as he walked downstairs. Even after he went through his morning routine and ate breakfast, Ava never showed. He headed to his classes, still in a bad mood. Surprisingly, his bad mood was apparently very obvious. The students in his first class all glanced at him with slightly fearful faces, and the two people that sat next to him shifted uncomfortably throughout the class. Then came his anima class. It was here that Dirk saw Ava since she had the same class. However, she looked at him from afar before ignoring him. The two went through the class separately. 
this caught the attention of the instructor since those two almost never separated. After looking at the two though, he smiled as if he understood. He left them alone, but that was to the detriment of the people who had to spar with Dirk and Ava. Those unlucky souls felt themselves under very real threat, especially those who fought Dirk. As Dirk spared, his mood actually worsened. He felt irritated at how weak his opponents were. He cursed their incompetence as he punished them with pain, only stopping as they screamed. It took the instructor sitting him out for the day to save the class. That class ended quickly, Dirk's classmates receiving a newfound fear. The man himself then entered his fire class, and it was Alec who immediately noticed the change. Whoa! You are positively bristling with violence. Did someone kill your pet? Alec spoke with surprise. Never once had he seen Dirk so angry. He had never seen him display hardly any emotion for that matter. This situation was about as foreign as foreign gets. Also surprisingly, Dirk didn't feel irritated near Alec. He calmed down as he sat next to his friend. For once, he also responded. No, I don't have a pet. Well maybe you should get one. My parents have one, and it does a good job of calming nerves. I don't have the time for a pet. Eh, I guess you don't. So what's got you all wrathful? Ava. Dirk answered, garnering wide eyes from Alec. He didn't actually expect Dirk to give him the real answer. Usually he brushed off his attempts at conversation. Alec quickly recovered though, taking it a bit seriously. For some reason, he really wanted to help Dirk out, and this was the perfect time to grow closer. Tell me what happened. She got mad at me for some reason. I don't know why. What caused her to be mad? I just told you. I don't know. No, I mean what happened before she got mad. What were you guys doing? We were talking. About? I told her not to worry about repaying me for some potions I gave her after the tournament last year. The potions are expensive, but I told her that it didn't matter. Dirk huffed as he spoke. Alec went silent as he seriously pondered. Hmm. I'm not sure what it would be then. How did you talk to her? I was stern since she couldn't seem to get it through her thick skull. Then that might have been it. She probably got defensive since you spoke harshly. How you say things to a girl means a lot, my friend. I don't think it's anything an apology can't fix though. Maybe. Don't worry it'll pass. Even then, you should cheer up a bit. We leave tomorrow, and we can't have our best fighter grumpy in the dungeon. We all gotta be sharp. Right. Thanks. Of course. Alec smiled, euphoric over his success in assisting Dirk. Dirk also calmed down, returning to his more rational self. He seemed to have understood Ava's anger, and with this solution, he could solve the problem. Or so he thought. Chapter 49, Skill Slash Caravan Dirk went through his classes calmly for the rest of the day. This was especially so when he arrived at his enchanting class. It was here that he intended to complete his test. All the students arrived and immediately got to work. Dirk took out his piece of leather and proceeded to sift through all the different frequencies with his dark mana. The mana resonated with the leather more and more every time he switched frequencies. He felt himself getting closer, and his mind concentrated every time he felt the sensation of mana making contact with the leather. At some point though, Dirk found that the precision and concentration necessary for switching frequencies became surprisingly high. This was because he continually narrowed down a very specific frequency, so the difficulty in accurately obtaining it increased. However, this led him to think of something. He thought inwardly. Interface. Awaiting orders. Can you impart frequencies to mana? Like how I've been doing? Dirk asked. There was momentary silence before the AI spoke. Affirmative. Through observation of mana frequencies, a magical formula has been derived. Note, in order to impart unknown frequencies, your active assistance will be needed. Once a frequency is discovered, the immediate range will be saved for autonomous channeling. Sweet. Work with me then. 
with a happy smile, Dirk went back to focusing on his piece of leather. As he began to resonate mana again, he could feel his AI assisting in the work. It made the resonation much more precise and thereby much more reliable. Dirk smiled before continuing to scour various frequencies, constantly narrowing down the correct one. Eventually, after an hour or so of searching alongside his AI, the mana came close to binding. Upon resonating, a majority of the mana was left bound to the leather. It actually formed a half enchantment, but overall it was a failure. Dirk wasn't concerned as he continued to slightly change frequencies with his AI and form half enchantments. Then, the moment came. As soon as Dirk started another enchantment, he could feel it. The dark mana he controlled streamed into the leather like ink, perfectly binding to it. He withheld his excitement as the AI locked in on a frequency and his mana formed the full rune. Finally, it was completed. So you've done it. Dirk didn't notice the teacher standing in front of him, so he snapped out of his tunnel vision when he heard the surprised, deep voice. The teacher carefully grabbed the leather out of Dirk's hands, looking at it. All the other students were staring at him as well not unlike when the first boy completed his enchantment. Well done. Now, all you need to do is enchant the blue leather, then you'll have passed. Take all the time you need. The teacher set the piece of leather back on Dirk's desk with a nod. However, Dirk wasn't paying any attention to him. His focus was turned inward. Within Dirk's chest, he felt a strong fluctuation from his mana heart. More than that, he felt some changes to his mana sense. The mana around him became a bit more clear, and his mind seemed to sharpen. He felt reinvigorated and magically stronger. Then, some notifications appeared in his vision. Attention! Skill acquisition successful. Dirk Strider has earned the skill, Mana Resonance, Grade 5. Profile Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, 2 plus. Rank, 3 plus. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7, Mana Resonance, Grade 5. Dirk looked at the profile in front of his face, specifically the new skill he gained. Ever since Dirk had arrived in this world, he had a skill in the form of his AI interface. It was the same AI that was with him on Earth, and this AI was kept with him even after crossing over. However, Dirk had never known what a skill was. After all, the interface couldn't exactly be defined as a skill, more like a passive tool. That was until he entered the academy. It was here that Dirk was taught what a skill was. According to the school, skills were abilities that the soul developed. Skills weren't simply applications of mana, like spells. Spells took mental energy and mana to form and use. On the contrary, skills didn't. Because a skill was utilized by one's soul, technically, it didn't consume any energy at all, such was the nature of a soul. However, because of the nature of some skills, Mental energy is used in tandem, thus not allowing a skill to be used infinitely. It was because of skills that a distinction was made between the soul and the mind. Each mage manipulates mana using mental energy. At first, mages had thought that mana was manipulated by the soul. But when skills were studied, they realized that their usage didn't require, or at least consume, any energy at all. That meant that the soul was beyond the concept of energy but it also meant that there was another source of energy that limited one in controlling mana. Thus, mental energy was discovered, and souls took on a new definition. At the same time, mages came to realize that skills were transcendent tools that defied the known world. However, even in Dirk's time, there wasn't much known about skills. This was because studying the soul was nearly impossible, and also because nobody ever talked about their skills. Another thing that limited their study was the fact that they were rare. Skills weren't rarer than having three attributes, at least low-grade ones weren't, but they were by no means common. There was no exact process or formula to gain a skill. It was rumored that to gain a skill, one had to know how to do something perfectly. 
their very soul had to understand the way in which something was done, and not even the person themselves could know if they were able to do something perfectly. If they did, then usually, that person would gain a skill. And the skill would boost their prowess to a whole other level. Skills were also classified by grade, not unlike how mana crystals were classified by tier, and even low-grade skills were extremely useful. It minimized the amount of energy one had to expend by countless times. But although the skill itself took no energy to use, the results it produced did. This was the case with Dirk's new skill. He gained a skill that would let him resonate mana. Technically, activating the skill wouldn't consume any energy, but controlling mana would. At the very least, resonating with mana would be effortless, while the actual enchanting process would consume his energy. It was in this way that skills were limited. There was always a bottleneck. For warriors that developed martial skills, they were limited by their physical energy or anima. For mages, it was their mental energy or mana. Getting all this information helped Dirk realize how amazing skills were. More than that, it helped him realize how amazing his AI skill was and how useful getting more skills would be. His AI was already a grade 7 skill and had many usages, although he didn't tap into a lot of them since he wasn't a super soldier anymore. Now, he also had a grade 5 skill that let him resonate mana. Though, Dirk was surprised that the skill wasn't called enchanting, so he was led to believe that mana resonation had uses outside of just enchanting. He would have to discover them. With that, Dirk decided to try it out. He picked up the blue leather, and expressing the desire to resonate the mana, he felt something within him activate. The dark mana he channeled outward changed frequency as easily as breathing, and Dirk was able to easily guide in the mana and resonate it with the leather. After the AI effortlessly found the precise frequency, it was enchanted. This was despite the fact that the blue leather had a slightly different frequency than the lower quality brown leather. The skill made finding the frequency much easier, especially alongside the ultra-precise AI. He was thrilled after completing the enchantment, both by succeeding in his challenge and getting a new skill. He then handed the leather to his teacher, officially passing the test. With that, he was allowed to leave, so he did. On the way home, Dirk twirled the knife he forged between his fingers, obviously in a good mood. While walking, he was wondering about the changes to his mana sense. He looked all around him at the elements in the atmosphere, occasionally pulling some out and into a ball above his hands. Controlling the elements felt smoother, and he felt like his mental energy was higher. This was all from the additional skill, so he became eager to start training and investigate the changes. Like this, he smoothly entered his home, but upon doing so, he was snapped out of his euphoria. He saw Ava, organizing supplies on the table. Oh, you're back early. Ava's eyes widened a bit as she glanced over, but she quickly turned her gaze back to the table. Dirk's good mood went away as he closed the door behind him. What are you doing here? Just gathering my portion of the supplies so I can prepare tonight. We're leaving tomorrow, remember? As if I would forget. I'll almost done anyway. I'll be out of your hair in a minute. Ava let out a small sigh as she continued packing items into her bag. Seeing her indifferent attitude, Dirk completely forgot about his earlier conversation with Alec during class. Even if he remembered, he didn't feel like apologizing in the slightest. He simply acted as if she weren't there as he prepared to do some training. Sure enough, Ava wasn't long to leave. Dirk glanced at her as she walked out with her bag slung over her shoulder. He huffed before walking down to his magic workshop, taking a look at his mana heart. Over time, Dirk's mana heart accumulated more and more. It was now an almost fully solid core of mana that rested within his actual heart. There was only a little bit more to go before it solidified fully, but Dirk had yet to actually reach that limit. However, now that he gained the new skill and took a close look at the heart, he felt like there was something he could do. While training the mana heart, Dirk needed to contract and expand the heart in parallel with his actual heart. While he wasn't training though, the heart just remained in place. To reconcile this inconsistency, the book containing his technique recommended that he enchant the heart with a rune that would match the beats of the mana heart to the physical heart. 
before, Dirk didn't have a clue as to how to go about this. But now, with the new knowledge and skill developed from his recent enchantment, he did. Interface. Awaiting orders. Pull up that rune for me. Activating his AI, Dirk had it search for the rune. The page in his technique book quickly popped up in his vision, and his eyes scanned the words and diagrams. After a few minutes of reading, however, his face turned distraught. The rune on the page was rather complex. The rune that he formed earlier in the enchanting class was very simple, a tier 1 rune in fact, so Dirk didn't have a hard time with it. However, this rune looked like a tier 3. Such a rune would be used in a tier 3 spell, and not only was Dirk still only a tier 2 mage, but he was only learning tier 2 spell theory right now. Needless to say, even learning how to form the rune would be a challenge. Enchanting it would be another. Dirk stared at the rune, analyzing it for a long while before deciding to try and form it. Because his mana heart was made from the earth element, he formed it from the same element. Earth mana streamed out into the air in front of him. However, it had trouble taking on the form of the rune. Forming runes was both as simple and not as simple as matching a shape. The shapes of mana actually had meaning, and to form the shape, one had to find the meaning. If you didn't find the meaning, the shape would come out random or jumbled and have no effect. This was what teachers like Geralt meant when they said that one had to comprehend their element. Comprehend the element, and forming the runes would become easier since one could find the meaning behind them. This was the problem Dirk had right now. He had only formed tier 2 runes up until now, so trying to form a tier 3 was a step above his current ability. But he would not try it. This could be considered training as well. Though, he wondered why his technique would require him to form a tier 3 rune before bringing him to that level. Was this a test from the book? Unfortunately, it didn't seem like he would be able to pass in a short amount of time. He was able to get some easier portions down, but the rest was a mystery. Luckily, it seemed that like he could complete a given time. He decided to work on it while he was away on this upcoming expedition. After that, Dirk went on to simply train the heart. He began to contract the heart alongside his physical heart while concentrating earth mana on it. He also used his mana lungs technique, breathing in and out mana. Mana lungs had almost become like actual breathing now, and he was getting closer to the point where he could breathe indefinitely. He realized that mana lungs was not only a way to intake mana, but train one's mental energy. If his mental energy regeneration could outpace his consumption with mana lungs, then he could use it all the time without limit, almost like a skill. Thinking that far, he wondered if it would actually become a skill. He would definitely welcome it with open arms. While training, he also thought about his destruction cycles. Dirk knew he was getting close to totally enhancing his blood, but it was definitely taking longer than expected. He didn't know if it was just because it was the blood or if destruction cycles got less effective over each rank, resulting in more cycles being necessary. Either way, he hoped it wouldn't take much longer, not that he didn't have the patience if it did. A couple hours later, Dirk left the room with a splitting headache. Walking to the kitchen, he went on to make himself a meal. As the food cooked, he did some small preparations for his leave tomorrow. He pulled out his armor and weapons going through his supplies as well to make sure he had everything. He checked everything off his list by the time the food finished. He quickly ate and then headed to bed, falling into a deep slumber. Hey Dirk! Over here! The next morning, Dirk walked over to the academy gates. Slung over his shoulder were two bags, one holding his armor and weapons while the other held all his supplies. He was dressed in comfortable and plain clothing, intending to be relaxed on this long ride. Upon meeting with his party though, he was surprised. All of them were fully geared, armor and all. He looked at them weirdly, as did they to him. Alex spoke first. Hey, why aren't you geared up? Why are you? You said it's two days to the dungeon, so we'll just be sitting in a carriage the whole time right? Ah, uh, yeah? Well, I don't know about you guys but I'd rather not sit around in my armor for all that time. Hearing Dirk, Alex's face dropped a bit as he pondered. Why was he geared out to fight when they would just be sitting around for hours on end? 
there was no point, and the armor would make them much more uncomfortable. Ava, Garrett, and Kazma were the same as him. They thought about it before realizing they would just look like a bunch of oddballs traveling with their gear on. Alec quickly spoke up. I think we should reconvene. Everyone be back here in twenty. Pack your gear into a bag like Dirk, just don't forget anything. See ya. Saying that, Alec waved and quickly ran back to his house. The others also left, going back to their dorms to change. Dirk was left there by himself. He looked around and decided to take a seat by the academy gate to wait. Twenty minutes later, everyone was back dressed out in comfortable clothing and with a bag full of their gear. With that, Alec led them out of the academy. They walked down a few streets of the city. All around, there were hundreds of ordinary people along with quite a few mages or warriors. The shops they passed by bustled with activity and prosperity, especially the food shops. Those places released fragrant aromas that made the group want to stop and take a bite. But they trudged forth, eventually coming upon a large building that was surrounded by a parking space. Dozens of wagons were stationed around this place, most filled with boxes of goods. There were also many groups of people standing around the wagons as if waiting to board them. Upon arriving, Alec left the group to go talk to a man within the building. He later came walking out side by side with a merchant who took a look at the group. This is our group. I see. Well, you guys are surely on time, and I have plenty of space. Welcome aboard. Alec introduced the man to the group, after which he nodded. This was the transportation that Alec had arranged. Merchants were constantly traveling from city to city and town to town. Because of this, it was common for groups of people to hitch rides with them, especially dungeon divers. The place they were at was a place that specifically facilitated this kind of transportation. If you needed to head somewhere, you came here to find your destination and see when a merchant would be ferrying to there. The only downside to this was the fact that it wasn't guaranteed to find a merchant going to your destination. If that were the case, one needed to go and hire a transport service, which always cost more. Thankfully, they were lucky enough to find one. After settling things with the merchant, the group waited around his caravan. There were six wagons that he was moving, and they would be piling into one of them. The wagon was mostly cleared out, and the boxes that were in there had thick layers of wool over them. It could be used as a bed, and it wasn't that uncomfortable to sit on. This obviously wasn't the first time this merchant had catered to people like them. They all threw their bags and gear into one corner, situating themselves within the covered wagon. After some time, the merchant came back to notify them that they were about to set off. It wasn't long after that their wagon started to move, and the caravan steered out of the parking lot and onto the streets of the city. They had officially embarked on their expedition. Meanwhile, as they set off, a pair of eyes watched them from the surrounding crowds. It was Dirk's mother, Cecilia, and she watched them drive away with a sigh. He could have at least let me know. Oh well. If he's with Alec, he'll at least be with someone decently competent. That man's son is surely taught well. Saying that, she turned and walked away. However, there was yet another pair of eyes that Cecilia was unaware of lurking in the area. This person, clad in ordinary clothes and not releasing even the slightest hint of power, observed Dirk's caravan with a smile. The next moment, darkness enveloped his feet, and he disappeared with a single stride. Chapter 50 Heat Ugh, my butt hurts. Ava grimaced as the carriage rolled along the bumpy road. Although there was actually suspension in the wagon, it didn't totally negate the rattling and vibration. Luckily, when she activated some of her anima, her muscles were cured of their numbness. For a little while at least. The group had been on the road for over a day now. After leaving the capital city, nothing eventful happened. It was actually incredibly boring. The only exciting thing that happened was when they passed through a town, and that only lasted an hour. At all other times, they could only see green plains, a few tree patches, and lots of farmland. They were stuck doing nothing as they sat in the rear wagon, only occasionally socializing before returning to silence. Fortunately, 
being in each other's presence for so long served to make them all more comfortable with each other. However, there was one thing Dirk had learned during this time. Garrett and Kazma, the two recruits, were actually in a relationship. Dirk noticed this at night as the two made out in the darkness and fell asleep in each other's arms. He had only noticed since he had keen senses. Also, since he was kept from engaging in any activity, his energy levels were high. This meant that he went to sleep late and woke up early. Thus, he heard all the lips smacking, and when dusk came, the two separated before everyone else woke up. Unfortunately, Dirk woke up earlier than anyone, and they realized that he now knew their secret. But Dirk pretended like he hadn't heard or seen anything, much to the appreciation of the two lovebirds. However, he was surprised and curious. Surprised that they were in a relationship at such an age, and curious about what it felt like. While Dirk thought about it, he found himself subconsciously glancing at Ava. But when he remembered that they were mad at each other, he glared slightly and turned away. The two hadn't spoken to each other throughout the whole ride, and he wouldn't be the first. Luckily, this boring wagon ride was almost over. As the sun set on their second day of travel, they finally arrived at the dungeon town. The merchant's caravan stopped in a parking area, prompting the party to hop out and stretch their stiff limbs. Ack! Finally! We're here! If we earn enough, we can get a better ride next time. Thank you for the transport, sir. As the others cracked their joints, Alec approached the merchant and thanked him. The merchant had already been paid, so their business was done. The merchant bid them goodbye, and the group left the parking area. As they walked into town with their bags slung over their shoulders, they observed all the passers-by. Not unlike the dungeon town they visited during their first dive, there were many people geared up and armed. As a result of their recent combat, both they and the bags of loot they carried released waves of odor. The group could see dark yellow blotches on some people's armor, likely the color of the monster's blood that they killed. Dirk recognized the town to be similar to a Midwestern one. Before coming to this world, he had only seen such style places when he visited old ghost towns on Earth. The buildings were wooden, the roads dirt, and the sun hot. Disregarding the humans walking around the place, dwarves and hybrids had a rather large presence in this town. Most were seen in gear while only some ran shops. Not surprisingly, there were many weapon and armor repair shops, along with some potion shops. The next most popular buildings were inns and restaurants. As a town that catered to the people who dove in the dungeon, this much was expected, and there wasn't much in the way of luxury. So, what do we do now? Garrett asked as they seemed to walk down the street aimlessly. Alex stopped and thought for a second. Hmm, well, we need to enter the dungeon. But first, we need to get information about it. That'll determine our next steps. I heard the Dungeon Association has information about that stuff, so let's go there. Saying that, he turned on his heel and headed for the Association building. The building wasn't exactly hidden. It was taller than most and located close to the dungeon entrance. It also had a huge sign plastered across its front that read Dungeon Association. The group walked inside, a bell ringing to announce their arrival. The place was busy since the day was ending, so Alec waited a bit to talk to a receptionist behind a wooden desk. Since the association specialized in this kind of stuff, and this was a popular dungeon, they obviously had the information they needed. Of course, there was a fee of ten gold, but it wasn't anything they couldn't pay for. Though, it did cause them to cringe. Ten gold was a lot for just some information. Alec received a small stack of three pages. Each page detailed the dungeon layout, the location of the havens within, the monster types, and the monster power distribution throughout the dungeon. Dirk glanced at all three, and his AI documented them instantly. The first thing the group noticed was how big the dungeon was. From the entrance to the opposite end where the monster king was, it was about 80 miles. This was many times bigger than the gremlin dungeon, and it immediately forced Alec to rethink his plans. The second piece of information didn't help either. Alec quickly read about the landscape of the dungeon and found that it was a desert. The first half of the dungeon desert was pure sand. 
There were mountains of sand dunes everywhere, and the climate matched this unforgiving wasteland. The paper said that the days were filled with blistering heat, and the nights were icy cold. As expected of a desert, but that fact didn't make it any more bearable. Luckily, the unforgiving landscape only lasted for half of the dungeon. The second half was a more standard desert landscape. Dead and dry dirt, sparse but tenacious plant life, and even more heat. However, despite this part of the landscape being a bit more bearable, the monsters made it not so. The third detail they focused on was the monster type. This dungeon held two monster types, each associated with their part of the landscape. The first was dune worms, and as the name implied, they were worms who worked their way under the sand. These worms would strike from below, slithering through the sand and targeting legs. They were difficult to hit and avoid, but luckily, they were at least somewhat easy to spot. If one saw shifting in the sand, that always meant there was a dune worm underneath. Not only that, but the sand would scratch against their hard carapaces, making it easy to pick out by hearing. Plus, because the nights were so cold, the worms would burrow to retain body heat. Thus, nights on the sand dunes were totally safe. It was only during the day that they would come back and surface. The second monster lived in the second half of the dungeon on the dirt landscape. These monsters were called fire skinks, and they were lizard creatures that roamed the dry desert. These skinks camouflaged with their environment, making them difficult to initially spot. The smaller ones were only a couple feet long, while the more powerful ones could grow to the size of an adult man. By themselves, the skinks weren't so bad. However, these skinks were capable of spitting fire, making them a dangerous foe to face. The page described how many divers would fail to spot a skink and then get ambushed by a wave of fire. It wasn't uncommon for eyes to be burned or leather armor to be incinerated. The fire would soften their targets, and then they would rapidly crawl over and tear at the target with their claws and sharp teeth. Along the way, they would continue to spit fire. The only consolation was that they only had so much fire to spit, but if there were enough skinks, then it would seem endless. Needless to say, they were a very risky monster to fight. However, there was no way for the group to avoid them. Their job was to retrieve 140 grade 3 fire mana crystals, and the source of these crystals was the fire skinks. They would have to kill, at the minimum, 140 fire skinks. Not only would this take a long time, but it was very likely that they would get hurt in the process. Other than the landscape and the monsters, they read that there were four havens. One was stationed near the entrance, two were stationed in the middle of the sand dune area toward the east and west, and the other one was stationed in the middle of the dirt desert in the second half of the dungeon, altogether creating a diamond shape. Alec immediately knew they would have to make their way toward the furthest haven, but that haven was 65 miles away from the entrance. It would be a treacherous walk there, and he suddenly wasn't feeling so confident. But he didn't back down just yet. At the very least, they would try their hand. If it proved to be impossible, then they would just have to drop the job. Thankfully, the academy didn't punish one for failing to complete a job, so there was no penalty other than the money they spent to prepare and for transportation. The group went through all the information several times before adapting their plans. Since the dungeon was so large, they would need to bring plenty of food with them. However, there was another piece of information they learned which they weren't sure how to feel about. Next to the monster descriptions, it indicated if they were edible or not. The dune worm wasn't, but the fire skink was. This meant that they could get food from the skinks and water from their water mages. Technically, this guaranteed their long-term survival, but they weren't sure if they wanted to survive in such a way. They decided to figure out how long they would spend on each dive when they went in for the first time. With that, they basically had everything they needed. Since it was the end of the day though, Alec didn't want to go in just yet. The group decided to find an inn for the night before heading in tomorrow. Two rooms for the next three nights. Six gold. All right. Alec nodded as he paid an innkeeper and received two keys. The group then found their rooms and divided between boys and girls. Alec, Garrett, and Dirk walked into their room beside the girls. Inside were two beds, both of which were decently clean. 
the walls and floors had scuff marks everywhere while the table had marks of vandalism all over its surface. The three glanced at everything, and Alex sighed. Well, you get what you pay for. Though I expected more out of six gold. Oh well, who wants the beds? The other can take the floor. We got plenty of blankets. You guys take the beds. Dirk spoke as he tossed his bags on the table. Garrett and Alec looked at each other before accepting his arrangement. The beds weren't exactly pristine, but they were better than the floor. Plus, neither felt like rebuking Dirk. Alec and Garrett prepared their beds while Dirk took out blankets and claimed a section of the floor. Dirk was lent blankets from the other two for more cushion, so he wouldn't have to deal with the hard surface. After the three were set up, Alec left to notify the girls of the time to wake up. Dirk took a seat on his blanket mattress. Hey ladies, we wake up at eight tomo dash. Hey! Get out! Ah! Bang! Suddenly, an odd series of muffled noises came from the wall next to them. Dirk's eyebrow raised confusedly, and Alec came walking back into the room the next moment. Sheesh! Of all the times to be changing. Ha ha! They got you good! Garrett laughed as he spotted a welt on Alec's forehead. Dirk suddenly understood and shook his head. After that, the night was calm. The group stayed up for an hour or so more before finally going to sleep. All right. Time to explore. The next day, Alec smiled with vigorous energy as he stood outside of the dungeon entrance. The rest of the party was behind him, fully geared in their armor. Garrett hovered in the middle carrying all of the luggage, as was the job he was given by Alec. Several other parties were in front of the entrance, waiting to be admitted. Nobody was restricted access to these lower dungeons, and one merely had to log their party down. For this, everyone would use an issued identification. For normal dungeon divers, this was given by the Dungeon Association. But for people like Dirk who attended the academy, they would use their student identification. The party took out their student cards. These cards had their names and a special number only used by the school. There was also their tier and rank. Finally, the biggest eye catcher was the academy seal that took up half the card. This was apparently recognizable by any town or city under the Horizon Empire, so no student would ever have trouble receiving services appropriate for their level. And upon showing the guard their cards, they caught a glimpse of how special it was. The guard looked at them with unconcealed surprise before logging their names and letting them pass. He didn't even ask any questions like he would the other divers. With that, the party entered. Alec entered first, then Dirk. Just like last time, Dirk felt a feeling of momentary suspension as he passed through the black film of the entrance portal. Upon stepping out though, that feeling vanished, though he was left slightly dizzy. Maybe as a result of their lesser power, Garrett and Kazma handled the entrance worse. Everyone quickly got over it though as they were greeted with an oppressive heat and swirling sand. So this is it. Alec stood in front, taking a look around. Behind them was the entrance of the dungeon, behind which was a wall that extended upward into the sky and outward toward the horizon. The ground they were stepping on was a rock platform with a layer of coarse sand over it, likely placed here intentionally for convenience. After taking a few steps though, the party walked onto the sand dunes. Look, there's the first haven. Spotting something in the distance, Kasma pointed. Everyone looked to see a grey stone building between them and the horizon. It was surrounded by hills of orange sand, but the pathway there was mostly flat. There were several other groups of divers walking to it in a line. Well, let's go then. Waving, Alec began their march. With Garrett in the middle, the five walked in a diamond formation, doing their best to follow the advice of their teachers. As they walked across the sand, the group was quick to realize how difficult it would be to fight. There was barely any solid footing below them, and sudden movements would result in slipping. It greatly mitigated their power and it made them nervous to encounter anything within the dunes. It was only Dirk who already knew the consequences of being in a sandy place. Even he didn't have a way to circumvent this problem though. 
the only thing he could do to maintain peak combat ability was to find balance and stability in his movements. Simply put, he would just need to adapt, and he knew he was at least good at that. Luckily, maybe because the dune worms knew this pathway was frequented by divers, the group didn't encounter any on the way toward the haven. After a long walk, they finally entered the stone fortress, relieving themselves of the blistering desert heat. Ugh, that was more difficult than I thought. Garrett was the first to lay down. The inside of the haven was easily 30 degrees cooler than outside. Dirk estimated that the ambient heat of the desert approached 110 degrees. It definitely was unbearable for a normal human across long periods of time, but they weren't normal. Dirk and Alec had the fire attributes, rendering them basically immune to the outside heat. Ava and Kazma were also handling it well since they had the water attributes. However, Garrett was the odd one out with neither of these attributes. He was an air mage, giving him no noticeable resistance to the heat. He also had full armor on and carried several bags. Thus, he took the full brunt of it. He was already sweating and looked tired. Alec saw this and frowned. The heat was obviously a problem for their porter, and he clearly couldn't last until the next haven that was still sixty miles away. Let alone fighting their way there, he would barely be able to walk there. This was a big problem. They needed to get to the other half of the dungeon to fight the fire skinks, but Garrett was their weak link. If they didn't solve this problem, they would need to leave him behind. This would make them down a man and force them to carry their bags themselves, reducing their fighting ability. Alec pondered for a while, the problem becoming obvious to everyone else. After some time though, Ava grabbed her bag from Garrett and pulled something out. It was a disc that looked to be made of ice. Here. Put this on your chest. All right. Garrett took the ice disc confusedly. He did what she said though, and when the disc stuck to his skin, he was flooded with a cooling sensation, as if his veins were filled with ice water. Ah. This is amazing. What is this? Something from the academy. I had bought it on a whim. Didn't think it would come in handy. Well, it's sure saving my life. Thank you. Sure. There's one problem though. It only lasts for a day of use before running out of cooling power. If we don't use it at night, it might be able to get you through two days. So we need to fix this problem within the next two days. Alec chimed in. He noticed how useful that ice disc was, but it was unfortunate that it wouldn't last longer. They would be here for much longer than two days. We should check the Dungeon Association. I know for a fact that they sell things there, ones that would help with the dungeon we're in. There has to be something that can help protect Garrett from the heat. It might cost more gold, but there's no way around it. So are we leaving? Yes. Come on. Saying that, the group turned around and left the haven, walking back to the dungeon exit. Chapter 51, Trek Slash Harbinger Alright, how is it? Good, but not as good as the ice disc. Garrett answered Alec as they walked back into the haven. Currently, he was wearing a necklace that bore a disc of orange rock. This orange rock was similar to the ice disc Ava had given him. This was the heat protection item they had found at the Dungeon Association. The cost of one necklace was five gold, and its function was to mitigate the ambient heat. It lowered the heat by about 30 degrees, making it warm but not hot for Garrett. For the same cost, the necklace wasn't nearly as refreshing as the ice disc that actually cooled his body. However, they couldn't expect much from the Dungeon Association that sought to make as much money as possible from the things they sold. Luckily, the necklaces would last three days each. They had bought five on the spot, an amount that would hopefully get them through the job. It was a decent deal, so the group was quick to get back into the dungeon. Garrett could bear the heat much better now, though there were still some signs of perspiration. Unfortunately, Alec could only tell him to drink plenty of water. All right, now that we have that settled, we need to make our way to the farthest haven. I'm thinking we can head to one of the ones in the middle as a rest stop before setting off on the final trek. Sound good? Sounds good. Then let's start. Weapons out. 
Alec placed his hand on his sheath, prompting the others to check their weapons. Ava had her axe, Dirk had his variety of weapons like the bow, hatchet, knives, and spear, and Kazma had a short magic scepter. This weapon had actually surprised Dirk when he first saw it. It was apparently supposed to slightly amplify her magic ability, whether it was gathering mana or controlling it. The party exited the other side of the haven. From there, as far as the eye could see, there was nothing but sand dunes. This time it was much more treacherous, with large hills and plenty of dune worms. They could only walk onward though. Alec took the lead, turning northeast toward the next haven and marching. The others grouped back up into a diamond shape, keeping their ears out and eyes on the sand. Eventually, they encountered their first dune worm. Dirk heard one slither through the sand at the same time that Alec spotted the moving mound. I got it. Alec unsheathed his sword, keeping an eye on the mound that rapidly approached. When it got close, Alec stabbed down. Shink! The sword buried itself in the sand, but surprisingly, there was no response. Alec was confused before the worm suddenly jumped out of the sand. The worm was a nasty-looking thing that grew to about three feet long and a foot wide. It had no eyes and two rows of long, protruding teeth that looked more like claws. Its carapace matched the sand perfectly while various white hairs stuck out from between its staggered shells, acting as feelers. Upon jumping out of the sand, its teeth pointed out and clamped down on Alec's calf. He panicked as the teeth scratched against his armor and swung his sword down on the worm. Crack! Screech! The worm screamed as the blade struck its shell, breaking through it and cutting flesh. This caused its body to thrash around, and Alec lost his footing. The two went to the floor as the worm continued to chomp at his leg. Alec kept swinging his sword at the worm, breaking its carapace in multiple places and drawing blood. The others watched, unsure of what to do. They couldn't just go up to him and swing their weapon at him. However, Dirk didn't worry about this dilemma as he pulled out his hatchet and rushed over. Stop swinging. When Dirk got close, he punched Alec's hand that gripped the sword. The sword went flying away, and Alec almost wanted to curse at Dirk for a seemingly stupid move. However, Dirk was quick to act, and he brought his hatchet down. Splat. Asterisk screech. Asterisk. The worm screamed even louder as the hatchet plowed straight through the carapace, burying itself into its body. Dirk chopped three times in succession in different places, the last being right on the head. With that, the worm instantly died, letting go of its grip on Alec's leg. Alec huffed, his adrenaline still coursing through his body. Dirk was calm as he pulled out his hatchet, kicking away the worm. You all right? Ah, uh, yeah. Thanks. Alec nodded as he calmed down. He had lost his cool, something that he shouldn't have done. He inwardly cursed himself as he stood up. Here. Oh. Dirk handed him his sword as he dusted off sand. By the way, never chop at yourself with a sword. Take out your knife next time. You don't want to take off your own limb. Yeah, you're right. And watch how you flail that thing. You don't want to hit someone that might try to help. Right. Sorry. Alec accepted Dirk's criticisms as he sheathed his blade. He had been momentarily angered by Dirk knocking his sword away, but that was so he could take control of the situation. Regardless, the things he said were common sense for a sword user such as him. He cursed himself again for being so careless. Damn. That worm was strong. Kazma. I would keep your distance from any worms you see. Your armor might keep them from piercing your body, but they will bruise you. I wouldn't be surprised if the stronger ones could break bones with that bite strength. Alec spoke as he massaged his leg. Because he was a body refiner, he could take much more damage before being hurt. However, he was surprised at how heavily those worms could clamp down. Even he might have been bruised, and this was only the first one that they encountered. Kasma nodded seriously. If it could hurt a body refiner, then it would absolutely injure her who wasn't one. This was the major disadvantage to lower-tier mages. Until they learned essential skills for movement and protection, 
they would be susceptible to close-range bodily harm. They needed to keep their distance from all enemies. This was why those who could be both mages and body refiners were powerful. Alec could take damage to his body and still function, whereas a normal mage might have already had his bone broken or muscles bruised. However, it was rare to have both an attribute and anima. Placing his hand on his leg, Alec closed his eyes. There was a soft glow of light for a few seconds before dimming. He then shook his leg out. Okay, I think I'm good. Let's reshape into a triangle and keep going. Kazma, you can move with Garrett. Alec directed his group. Kazma nodded and moved next to Garrett. Dirk then moved up, he and Alec taking the front while Ava held the rear. They then continued walking, trudging through the sand. It wasn't long though before another worm was spotted from Dirk's side. This time though, Dirk had a good idea as to how to handle them. He took out his two spear halves, piecing them together before pointing down at the oncoming worm. Shick! Thrusting the weapon, Dirk buried it in the sand. There was a muffled scream as sand was kicked up. He had pinned the worm. He then equipped his hatchet while holding down the spear. Stepping closer, he brought the hatchet down on the worm that had flailed to the surface, killing it in one chop. Wow, you make it look so easy. Alex spoke as Dirk removed the spear and sheathed his hatchet. Dirk didn't respond, instead looking at the worm. Should we be harvesting anything from the worms? The worms? H.M., maybe they're mana crystals. I don't know of anything else of value. All right. Nodding, Dirk bent down and looked through his mana sense. He could sense a dense bundle of earth mana right in the front where its head was. Taking a knife, he pierced between two of the shells of the carapace and dug around, eventually pulling out a small brown-orange marble. It looked like a small solid turd. Here. Cleaning it off, Dirk tossed it to Garrett. Garrett caught it before taking out the loot bag and throwing it in. Since the marbles were solid, as long as the flesh around them was wiped off, they wouldn't carry any horrible stench. With that, they left the body behind, continuing their march. Because monsters within dungeons didn't breed, they were spawned. Upon a monster's death, the dungeon would gradually decompose them until there was nothing left behind. This process took a long time though, so in the short term, bodies would stack. Sure enough, the group came around the occasional dead worm. Some worms were cut in half, others were mauled to death by several slashes, and some were stabbed cleanly. Their yellow blood seeped into the sand, leaving damp clumps and wafting odors. Unfortunately there were virtually no breezes or winds, so the smells lingered around for hours. The group walked for hours as the sun rose further up into the sky, coming across dozens of dune worms along the way that would hunt in groups. Many were handled by Dirk while Alec got used to killing them with a sword. Ava got plenty of action too as worms snuck around behind them. Since she had an axe, as long as she hit her mark, they would die quickly. Along the way, the entire group drank tons of water, especially Garrett who constantly sweat. Their water bags were constantly drained, causing them to take small breaks where Kazma would refill them. Using funnels, she would conjure water balls and dump them down into the bags. They continued like this for seven hours. At this point, it was already well past noon, and the sun lowered to the other horizon. It was here that the group found another marker that directed them toward the haven. However, they were still a little under ten miles away so they decided to take a break at the marker. Sheesh. This heat is not okay. Garrett spoke as he dropped all the bags. The loot bag clanked with a few dozen mana crystals, the fruits of their labor. By now, his armor was thoroughly drenched in sweat. If it weren't for the fact that he was a body refiner, his legs would be giving out too. In fact, it was now Kazma who was doing the worst. Her legs were aching from all the hiking. Walking through the sand was fine for a while, but at a certain point it became laborious. She had reached that point a while ago, and she knew she would bear the consequences of this hike the next day. She was now wishing that she was a body refiner like every other person in the group. The only consolation was that she could bear the heat better than Garrett. We have plenty of time to recuperate. 
At night, the dune worms don't come out, so we won't have to worry about anything once the sun goes down. We can continue to the haven then. Alex spoke as he went to one of the bags, pulling out a blanket and sitting on it. The others agreed with his plan as they took a seat as well, letting their legs rest. Dirk watched as his group members slipped off their boots, dumping out little piles of sand. Seeing that, he wiggled his feet to see if there was any sand inside. He couldn't feel anything though. In fact, his boots were still very comfortable, his feet not suffering from anything like blisters or soreness. His mother really did do a good job with his gear. Pulling out blankets, everyone either took a seat or laid down. As they did, the sun continued to set. The sand gradually turned from orange to pink, and the temperature rapidly dropped. As they rested, there were only a few dune worms that came over to them. Dirk easily took care of these, and when night finally fell, there were no more threats. It was only when the cold set in that Alec finally stood up. The others got up with him, their legs sufficiently recovered. Since there was no more heat, Garrett took off his heat protection necklace before hoisting the bags. Like this, the group made the final trek to the haven. Upon arriving, they were surprised to only see a few groups of people who were camping out. Picking a spot, they also set up camp before going to sleep for the night. As Dirk completed his first day, in a secret area on the edges of the Horizon Empire, there was a tall mountain. This mountain stood among droves of tall trees. The temperature here was tropic, meaning tons of various wild animals prospered in this lush jungle, and rain fell often. On this mountain there was a secret of entrance that led down into a series of caves. These caves were all man-made and surprisingly large, able to fit the same amount of people as a regular town. There were stone buildings everywhere, and between these buildings there were many adults and children who walked to and from. However, even disregarding the fact that it was within a mountain, this wasn't some normal town. All the children wore the same black clothes, and their heads were constantly lowered. They all looked either scared or apathetic. Both girls and boys alike, they were bruised, tired, but not weak. Their bodies sported tight muscles, none of them looking like normal kids. In their eyes were also sharp glints. Even the scared ones occasionally glanced around with acute senses. The adults were similarly special. Every single one gave off incredibly dangerous auras. In fact, those that didn't give off any aura were the ones the kids cowered the most near. The adults walked with trained steps, their violent gazes occasionally falling on the kids below them. Above them all though, there stood a man. From him, not even the adults could sense anything. This man wore a strip of cloth over his eyes. However, those he looked at could still feel a gaze on them, though they couldn't tell from where. This man was by no means blind, the way he utilized his senses being far beyond that of a normal person. The man stood within a room near the top of the mountain. He had one window that gave him a view of everything below, and another that gave him a view of the forest outside. His room was lit by ominous candles and decorated with bookshelves and odd paintings. Behind the man stood a younger woman who had a scar that ran from her eye socket back toward her ear. This woman glanced at the man with a bit of trepidation, mustering up courage before opening her mouth. He left not long ago. As you thought, his mother kept track of him. Of course she did. The man let out a deep sigh, the air in front of him whirling around from his powerful lungs. He scratched his graying beard. She probably has a feeling, though she doesn't want to believe it. Is the scout on him? Yes. He'll follow them to their destination and back. His last transmission told us that he would be gone for around two weeks. Good. Although he's following him to evaluate his ability, I don't believe there's any need to. The man narrowed his eyes before turning around to a desk, taking a seat in a leather chair. Unlike that woman's other children, this one is almost too good to be true. Determination, discipline, and his skill set is perfect. I couldn't imagine a more suitable candidate. This little adventure of his will only show us his current combat ability, and whether or not he has a talent for killing, which I believe he does. Yes. But sir, his mother is a tier 6. Sure she hasn't reached into tier 7 yet, 
but her killing ability is no less than one with her rank. After all, you taught her. The young woman drifted off as the man's gaze fell on her. His eyes were covered, but she still couldn't help but cower as she felt that piercing gaze through the cloth. I know. However, that's precisely why I'm doing what I am. She knows that the day will come. That's why she pays so much attention to that amazing son of hers. She knows that her talent was passed to him, and yet she hopes that he won't be subject to what she was. That's always been her weakness. Friendship and familial bonds. Compassion and a love for others. It could be said that I'm touching a reverse scale. But that's exactly why I'm going to handle this personally. The man lowered his head, slightly complicated emotions brewing in his mind. The next moment though, he seemed to radiate a sense of wrath. I will have another weapon, one that I will sharpen and hone to absolute perfection. He will surpass even his mother. And she can do nothing, because her weakness prevented her from surpassing her teacher. This is her own fault. And to think she thought she could escape her past. Marrying a measly Marquis? You think becoming friends with a duke will protect your family? Nobody escapes me. Nobody escapes my fallen azures. Bang! His fist raised and fell, slamming the table in front of him. The young woman in front of him backed away hastily as the table partially disintegrated under an oppressive power of darkness. Realizing he lost his cool, the man took a few deep breaths. He faced the young woman. When the time comes, bring him to me, the child named Dirk Strider. He will become a weapon, an agent of necessary chaos. A new era is dawning, and those like him will be the harbingers of revolution. Chapter 52 Fire Skink The next morning, Dirk was quick to wake up. He woke up even earlier than the few other groups who were camping in the haven. Deciding to enjoy a refreshing morning, he left the haven and stepped outside. In just his plain cloth clothes, he felt the slightest chilling breeze, cold sand between his toes, and smelled the stagnant, dry air. On the horizon, the sun was only barely starting to rise. From here, it would only get warmer until those blistering heat waves returned. Dirk stood there for around an hour, employing his mana lungs. He breathed in and out the ambient mana just like normal breathing. He barely felt the slightest drain on his mental energy. This signified his ever-increasing proficiency and rising tear. It wouldn't be long until his mana heart would be finished, he believed that by then, he would really be able to use mana lungs like normal lungs. As he was enjoying his little euphoric training session though, he was suddenly interrupted by wiggling in the sand. Opening his eyes, he saw the body of a dune worm surface from below the sand. Its long teeth raised into the air, its carapace gleaming under the rising sun. It didn't seem to notice Dirk though, who stood there with statue-like stillness. Seeing that the worm was oblivious to him, he had a thought and smiled. Activating a bit of the anima in his body, he broke out into a sudden sprint, appearing beside the worm before it could react. Then, bringing his leg back, he swung at it with a kick. His foot slammed against the worm's carapace, slightly cracking it. The force pulled the worm's three-foot-long body out of the sand and sent it flying like a ball. Dirk smiled as the worm flew for almost 130 feet, finally landing with a whimpering squeal. He, goal! Dirk chuckled as he cheered to himself. Looking at the worm that writhed around in pain, he smirked. These worms were actually incredibly easy to kill for him. The others, like Alec, had a more difficult time than him. They couldn't accurately find the worms when they slithered under the sand, and when they popped out, they didn't have the reaction times to kill it before it either bit them or slammed into them. Luckily they had their armor, making up for their seriously lacking combat experience. Otherwise, Alec and even Ava would have broken legs. Dirk couldn't blame them though. He often forgot, but they were all only teenagers at 13 years old. The fact that they were doing these kinds of things was already surprising enough. He couldn't expect them to automatically have exceptional skills. However, he also couldn't help but feel a little stifled. If he were by himself, he may very well likely be able to complete this job at the same pace, if not faster than the group. 
but he wasn't by himself, and it had subconsciously become his responsibility to ensure each person's safety. Thus, he had to move at their pace. But he didn't mind this so much. After living for so many years as a child, Dirk had become used to the slower lifestyle he had now. It was rather carefree, and he didn't have death constantly looming over his shoulder. It wasn't so serious and critical, and he could take his time with things. While he still trained himself to his limits and never slacked, it could be said that he was becoming a bit complacent. But Dirk knew that this complacency was temporary. If he so needed to, he could operate as he did in his previous life. Only, there was no need to. Dirk had no threats or enemies. His only goals and challenges were in the form of training his mana and body and academics, like forging and enchanting. He knew that there was a wider world out there, but he didn't necessarily feel the need to rush into it. Instead, he felt like enjoying where he was now. He had more than enough experience with war, international politics, and living a life of constant battles. Others who had never seen the things he is might be eager to engage in that lifestyle. But him? For the first time, he could enjoy himself and others. He wasn't so quick to throw that away. Cause once he did, he knew he might never be able to go back. Various thoughts rushed through his head. It was only a few seconds though before he shook it, bringing his gaze back to the worm that was beginning to dive under the sand again. Waving his hand, a magic circle appeared. A single spike manifested next to his head. It was an earth spike, but unlike before, it had hints of metal in it. This was the effect of his mana heart becoming more solid and the metal element exposing its power. Dirk had been told that this metal element would come to strengthen his earth spells to a great degree in the future, but it was only now that he got hints of it taking effect. Pointing his hand, Dirk sent the spike flying. It zipped over to the dune worm before nailing through its carapace and planting itself in its body. The dune worm thrashed as blood spilled, and even though it hadn't died, Dirk turned around to leave. As he walked back into the haven, the worm's death throes quieted before it eventually went still. When he walked back to the camp, Dirk was surprised to see Ava up. The two glanced at each other before Ava turned away with a neutral face, as if he were a stranger. Thinking back to his morning rumination, Dirk sighed before walking up to her. Good morning. Ah. Uh -huh. Dirk's mood worsened as Ava barely hummed in response. He had finally caved and spoke to her first, and that was what he got. Taking a breath, he calmed before continuing. I want to apologize. He got straight to the point, causing Ava to be quiet and listen. She stood in front of him, gazing out into the distance but he knew she was listening, waiting for what he had to say. Dirk thought back to his conversation with Alec prior to leaving. I'm sorry for speaking how I did to you. I didn't realize that you might have your feelings hurt. All right. Thanks. I can try to refrain from raising my voice in the future. It was only that I wanted to make sure you had understood what I was saying. Huh. Wait, hang on. What exactly are you apologizing for? Stopping him, Ava questioned. He looked at her oddly. For raising my voice. Talking how I did to you which made you mad. Raising your voice? That's what you thought this was about? Suddenly, Ava burst with hostility. Dirk's face fell as he realized he misunderstood something. Dirk, you've yelled at me before. You've punched and driven me into the ground. I've bled from wounds that you've caused and you think talking a bit sternly to me was what hurt my feelings? Dirk frowned as Ava shouted. What she said made sense. But then what the hell was wrong? He hated this. Ava was getting mad at him, and he didn't know for what. What did he do wrong? He's done nothing but help her and care for her well-being, and then she goes and gets mad at him? As anger welled up within him, he opened his mouth. So? What is it? What did I do? I don't know what you want from me. Dirk, you dash. Ava was about to go off again when, in the corner of her eye, she saw one of the other parties climb out of their tents. Realizing that they were probably being too loud, she turned back to Dirk with a sigh. Dirk? Never mind. We'll talk about this later. 
she turned and climbed back into her tent, preparing her back. As she did so, Dirk stood outside, anger still flooding his chest. He wanted to grab her and force an answer out of her, but he restrained himself. That didn't stop Dark Mana from congealing around his fingers though. Feeling his Dark Mana move, Dirk looked down at his hand. Last time when he had first gotten mad, this Dark Mana had turned into claws. Then, he hadn't been in the right mind to care about this weird reaction. But now, in the midst of anger, he found himself wondering. Using his unyielding discipline, he closed his eyes and walked away, calming his mind. He then looked at his hands with apathy. The dark mana thin as his mind calmed, receding back into his body. This caused him to think. Does the dark mana become active with anger? Geralt had spoken about how emotion could spur the dark mana to move, as if it worked off of emotion. It seems like he wasn't wrong. For some reason, my dark mana only seems to want to come out when I'm emotional. Dirk came to this conclusion. He didn't know why, but emotion and dark mana had a link. Maybe this was why Geralt was so volatile and emotional himself. In order to become a great dark mage, one would have to be an emotional person, as that would ensure the easiest employment of their dark mana. But weren't his mother and sister dark mages? They didn't seem that emotional, especially not like Geralt. Or maybe they just weren't emotional around him. Dirk hadn't seen Rita much since she had entered the academy, and he had never seen his mother in action. But this led Dirk to think about something else. During his first kill initiation, he had lost himself in the desire to kill the goblin. He had such an overwhelming bloodlust, and it was so out of nowhere that Dirk only regained control of himself after the goblin was stabbed through the head. He had heard a voice beckoning him to draw blood, to end the goblin's filthy life. It was unlike anything he had felt before. This led him to believe that something about him was different. Seeing how Dark Manor reacted with emotion, he felt that it might also influence emotion. Was Geralt able to become a great dark mage because he was crazy, or did the dark mana make him crazy? Maybe it was both. But Dirk feared the latter. For now, he assumed that the dark mana influenced his emotion, and that he needed to be careful. It wasn't a good thing to get lost in emotion. Dirk had learned that long ago. In an intense battle, that could get you killed. Coming to that conclusion, Dirk shook his head. The dark mana on his hand fully dissipated, so he put it down and went to his tent. Alright, looks like we're finally here. Now comes the hard part. Alex spoke as he stepped onto flat, solid ground. Behind him were the sand dunes, and in front was the second half of the dungeon. The group had already left the haven. After exiting, they walked forward for an hour before reaching the halfway point where the desert became flat. This was about five miles from the previous haven. They had faced several dune worms, but all of them were dispatched with ease. Now, they didn't see any more, but this wasn't comforting. Now, they would have to fight the hard enemies. Alec looked around. There were scattered boulders, large holes in the ground, brown bushes, and rough dirt. Seeing the various visual obstacles, Dirk realized this could be much more dangerous than he thought. All these boulders and holes and bushes were places for these skinks to hide and ambush them. They wouldn't be able to see one from far away. The others didn't really have these thoughts. They were only thinking about how the skinks could spit fire, and that they needed to keep their eyes peeled. Alex spoke after they walked onto the flat land. We need to get to the next haven, and that's about 30 miles away. We should get there by nightfall. Unlike the dune worms, the skinks don't totally hide away. They're still a threat, and we won't be able to see them well at night. So we should try and move quickly. Thankfully the ground is flat, so we can at least walk faster. He spoke as he stepped forward. In the distance he could see heat waves, and the hot ground warmed his souls. If it weren't for his fire attribute, he would be struggling in this heat. This caused him to look at Garrett. Luckily, since Garrett trained Anima, his body was at least tougher. That combined with the heat mitigation necklace made everything bearable. It was only Kazma who complained about sore legs and feet. Unfortunately, she could only bear it and move forward. 
this was the labor a mage had to be willing to bear until they learned higher-level magic. The group carefully moved forward, Ava, Alec, and Dirk surrounding Garrett and Kazma in a triangle formation. Before leaving, Dirk had equipped every part of his armor. The dark gray metal and black leather was a stark contrast to the surrounding orange desert. Dirk's eyes scanned the surroundings from under his hood. He had even equipped the mask. The reason was because of the enemies he would be facing. The skinks could spit fire, and although he trusted his senses, he didn't want to get caught off guard and get burns. He was an assassin prowling in the open desert while the bright sun beamed down. It almost looked ridiculous, but he couldn't care less. He was alert as he kept his eyes peeled, taking in every detail. Enemy detected. Suddenly, Dirk was alerted. His AI highlighted a bush, outlining the silhouette of something behind it. This was yet another useful feature of the AI. It could take in the most minute details, and in cases where something was camouflaged, it would pick out the abnormalities. The result was an enemy detection. Dirk looked at the bush that was 30 meters away. Nothing was moving, but it didn't matter that he couldn't tell if there was something behind it. He stepped forward and extended his hand, grabbing Alec's shoulder. Hmm. Alec turned around and looked at Dirk. Dirk put his finger over his mouth, and seeing this, the group stopped. He then grabbed his bow, taking an arrow out of a quiver. Knocking the arrow, he pulled back. The string took rather substantial force to draw. The arrow was also tipped with some kind of metal Dirk was unfamiliar with. Nonetheless, Cecilia had assured Drick that the bow was quality, so he decided to trust her. He aimed at the bush that still maintained its stillness. Once he was lined up, he loosed the arrow. The arrow was almost entirely silent as it sailed across the thirty meters in an instant. Screech! Suddenly, as the arrow buried itself in the bush, a scream was heard. A fire skink raised its head as it howled. The arrow had pierced its abdomen. The others in the group were surprised. They hadn't even seen the skink. Should they have kept walking, they would have been taken by surprise. Someone would have been burned. But Dirk spotted the skink in time. He saved them a bad injury. Knowing that it had been caught, the skink screamed more and charged the group. It was shockingly fast as it traversed the ground with its long and sharp claws, leaving gouges in the dirt. Seeing how fast it was, Dirk realized he wouldn't even have enough time to draw another arrow. He threw his bow to the side, taking out his hatchet. He couldn't even use his spear since its two pieces had to be attached. Alec also drew his sword while Ava rushed to the front. But they were too late. The skink threw itself at Dirk who stood in front. Its mouth opened, and he could see a flame billow out of it. However, he didn't dodge to the sides or duck behind his armor. Instead, he proceeded to throw himself at the skink, diving out with his hand. Just as the fire was going to escape the skink's mouth, Dirk's two hands grabbed its upper and lower jaws. Activating the anima in his body, his arms erupted with tyrannical strength. He yanked the skink to the side pointing its mouth in another direction and totally diverting its aim. The fire was spit out, a long tongue of flame shooting out a few meters and igniting several other bushes. The skink started thrashing about when it was finished with its fire attack, but with Dirk's hand grabbing its jaws, there wasn't much it could do. The skink wasn't even in control of its body as Dirk slammed its mouth shut and pinned its head to the floor. After freeing up a hand, he equipped and brought down his hatchet. Splat! The hatchet plowed into the skink's spine. Its entire body immediately fell limp, its claws no longer able to thrash around. Dirk left the hatchet in the lizard as he expertly unsheathed a knife, bringing it around to its head. Slice! The knife pierced its eye socket, digging to its brain. The violent resistance faded from the skink's other eye, succumbing to the call of death. He then let go of the skink's jaw. As his hand relaxed, he could feel the shattered bone underneath his fingers. His grip strength had broken the skink's jaw. Alec stood to the side as Dirk removed his weapons, cleaning off the hatchet before shaking it. As always, Dirk made it seem so easy to kill these monsters. But he knew that he wouldn't be able to copy him. After cleaning the hatchet, 
Dirk kept his knife and scanned around the skink. He could detect a dense fire mana source in its neck. This was the mana crystal and the source of the skink's power. Cutting through the rough flesh, Dirk dug around before plucking out a hot stone. This stone was bright red and the size of a marble. Only 139 to go. Saying that, he stood up and tossed the stone to Garrett, who hastily caught it and dumped it in the loot bag. This was their job item, a fire mana crystal. They only needed 140 of these red marbles to complete what they came here for. After hearing him though, Alec frowned. He had a hard time imagining his group getting through this in one piece and without injury. He was also thinking that 170 gold wasn't nearly enough for everything they were doing. They had already spent quite a bit, and after dividing it among everyone, it may only barely cover expenses. It was a very small profit margin. But unless they completed the job, they wouldn't get anything. Although Alec had never worried about money in his entire life, he didn't feel good about taking a loss. This was even more so for those like Garrett and Kazma who didn't have the backing he did. They were barely able to get the armor and weapons they had. It was now up to them to use those to make money for themselves and their families. Chapter 53 Challenge After Dirk killed the first fire skink, the group continued walking. This time, they were quite a bit slower, their eyes warily staring at bushes that skinks could be hiding behind. However, around ten minutes after their first kill, they encountered another skink. As they walked across the desert with their weapons drawn, a pair of eyes gazed at them from within a large hole. The head was quick to sink back down though, not exposing itself and waiting for the right time to strike. Dirk was constantly scanning around, his AI sending him any important updates like recent track marks and such. He knew that a skink could come from anywhere, and he was actually most worried about all the fox holes. He couldn't see into these until he was close, so it would be close calls. Unfortunately, such an event was unavoidable. As the group got closer, the skink primed itself to fight. Its body heat up and prepared its fire spit. However, this was a slight giveaway. Abnormal heat fluctuations detected. Dirk's AI gave him an alert, and his head snapped to the heat source. However, Alec was the closest one to it. He also seemed to feel something odd as he looked down. Enemy in the hole! Dirk shouted, but it was too late. Alec's head barely turned to see a bright tongue of flame streaming toward him. He instinctively raised his arms. Ack! Alec yelled as the heat crashed into him, igniting his armor. He was like Dirk and also covered from head to toe. This naturally made him very safe against all forms of attack. However, his face wasn't covered, and flames slipped through his defenses. The flames covered his front side, and the skink wasted no time in charging. It launched out of the hole and jumped at Alec. Its claws grabbed at his armor and its weight threw the disoriented boy off balance. They went tumbling to the ground as the skink madly slashed at his body, its nails attempting to rip at the tough leather. Alec panicked under the sudden bombardment. He covered his face as he tried kicking off the skink, even throwing some punches to get it off and do damage. But his strength was limited, and the skink just stayed on top of him. Luckily, he had someone reliable on his team. There was a sudden stop to the skink's attacks as it raised its head. In front of it was Dirk with his hatchet, and it had no time to react before the blade came slashing down. Splat! The hand axe buried itself into the skink's head. Its body instantly went limp on top of Alec, and Dirk kicked the skink corpse off of him. Alec looked up at his savior, sighing in relief. I may have to start counting the number of times I owe you for saving me. He spoke with a smile, climbing back to his feet. He didn't find it amusing but he was beginning to get used to the sudden attacks and Dirk saving him. Dirk just smirked before harvesting the skink, plucking out another red marble. As he did so, Alec activated some of his light magic. He had high fire resistance as a fire attribute mage, so the fire the skink spit out didn't do too much besides singe some of the hair on his eyebrows and skin on his cheek. Besides the hair, there was nothing he couldn't heal. As for his armor, it held strong, worthy of the large sum of money his parents had spent on it. 
Dirk tossed the fireman a crystal to Garrett after plucking it, and the group began their walk again. Unfortunately, their encounters only increased. They came across a few more single skinks, Dirk usually spotting them and taking preemptive action. There was only one that caught them by surprise, and it was actually Ava who fell victim to the ambush. However, she was able to handle it better than Alec. Her martial arts training kicked in as the skink jumped on her, and she was able to kick the skink away before wielding her axe and chopping it. It took her three chops to kill it, and this actually resulted in the skink being separated into two halves. Everyone backed away as pools of blood flowed. All except for Dirk who harvested like he always did. After that, they began to encounter groups. Dungeons always got more difficult as one went deeper, and this was shown in two ways. The first was an increased amount of enemies. The second was the higher strength of the monster. Most people would have to take things slowly. They would skirt around the edges of a monster territory, only seeking out single monsters. Then, they would slowly work their way in toward groups of two. If they encountered a group of three, they would back out. But Dirk's group wasn't most people. Himself, Ava, and Alec were at the top of their class, and this class was within the academy. It was a school that regularly produced strong mages and warriors, and even the younger teens would be able to match the majority of adults in pure strength. This was because if one didn't come from the academy, it was unlikely that they had real talent. So young teens of the academy often pushed forward, doing their best to kill as many monsters as possible. They would only continue to grow as they killed more, so they didn't hesitate to. Plus, they desired money, so they were driven to complete jobs regularly. Dirk's group wasn't necessarily like this. Alec was cautious, as were Garrett and Kazma. These three were constantly worried about getting into a situation that would end badly. However, Dirk and Ava weren't worried. Despite them being mad at each other, Ava knew just how powerful Dirk was. She didn't have the slightest worry that they wouldn't leave this dungeon alive. Dirk had also shown Alec just how capable he was, so this encouraged him. He didn't mind taking the risk since he knew that Dirk would likely handle anything that went out of control. He did this perfectly in the Gremlin dungeon. So the group continued forward, their only concern whether or not they were going to make it to the next haven before sundown. However, despite their relative ease, Dirk was the one who was most concerned. If they encountered more groups, or bigger groups, he may not be able to protect everyone. He could kill quickly, but in the time that he was distracted, those skinks could set others ablaze. They merely had to spit once, and things could get nasty. This was especially so for Garrett and Kazma. They were the weakest links, something that caused Dirk's mood to worsen throughout the hours of hiking. Dirk had the urge to remove these group members of his seeing as how they never stepped forward to kill anything. He had the strong desire to be alone, or at least rid himself of these incompetent people. Even if it meant carrying a bag, he was willing to do it if it meant he could move quickly and efficiently. He felt slight anger arise within him whenever Kazma complained about her feet or when Garrett complained about his sweat-soaked clothes. He almost wanted to put them in front to fight the skinks, just so they would finally contribute to this expedition. But he didn't. He just stayed silent as they continued to traverse this unforgivable wasteland. And upon finally encountering a group of four skinks, Dirk decided to vent his anger. Ha! Ah. After spotting a skink, Dirk violently equipped his hatchet and charged. Alec and Ava did the same, each diving on a skink. After fighting enough, they had come to learn that taking the fight to the skink was the best way to stay safe. Dirk raised his arm, throwing the hatchet at the skink. The hatchet spun toward it, the blade landing on its body. The skink screamed in pain and spit fire, but Dirk had learned a new way to protect himself. Raising his hand, a shield of stone suddenly manifested in front of him. This disc blocked all the flame, the surface being damaged. After the fire dissipated though, Dirk tossed it away, continuing his charge. Seeing him charge, the skink rushed to meet him. It ran over with the axe in its body, raising its claws to slash Dirk. However, he didn't back away as he clenched his fist. Anima flooded his body and strengthened his muscles and he punched out with unstoppable force. 
Crunch. The fist landed on the skink's skull, instantly caving it in. Blood splashed as the skink flattened against the floor. Against a tier 3 skink, Dirk's rank 3 strength was more than enough to instantly kill it barehanded. Dirk's body then swung around, facing the others. Alec and Ava were brought into their own battles. Ava had developed her own trick where she would toss a water ball into the mouth of the skink, both blocking its fire and damaging it with the subsequent explosion. Alec though came up with a more brutish method where he would literally fight fire with fire. The flames of his and the skinks would clash, his usually winning and slightly burning the skin of the skink. He would then go in with his sword, slashing it until it died. Of course, Garrett and Kazma stood to the side, Garrett protecting the bags and Kazma staying out of the way. However, with four skinks, they were now in danger. The fourth skink went around, facing its unoccupied prey. Kazma and Garrett backed away but couldn't outrun the skink. The skink charged them, opening its mouth to fire. Luckily, Kazma had at least learned from those in front of her. Summoning five water balls, she flung them all toward the skink. The skink screamed as one of the balls was hurled into its mouth, exploding. The others also exploded around it, dealing damage. But it didn't kill it. Enraged, the skink shook off the building pane and charged them again. This time, it lunged at them with its claws. Kazma panicked. She knew that if she got scratched, it would leave large wounds. She feared the pain and cowered away, stumbling backwards. The next moment though, a leg came swinging in front of her. The skink that was lunging toward her was slammed away, its body flying for thirty meters and tumbling ten more. Kasma looked at Dirk who had punted the skink, sighing in relief. Dirk didn't spare her a look as he glared at the skink he kicked. It now had a giant dent in its skull and lay limp on the ground. He likely shattered all the bones in its head. He could even feel the crunch on his leg as he kicked. Nodding, he turned his attention to the others. Luckily, he wouldn't have to expend more energy. Ava quickly chopped her skink into pieces while Alec planted his sword in the skink's body, killing it. They steadied themselves with blood splattered across their legs. Dirk sighed as they finished, proceeding to harvest the mana crystals. Sheesh. That was close. Garrett sighed as the others settled down. Alec nodded in agreement, but Dirk let out a slight huff. Dirk plucked out the mana crystals from the four skinks. Walking over to Garrett, he didn't bother handing it to him as he snatched the bag and dropped in the crystals himself. Now, they had gathered about eighteen. The next moment, Dirk looked at the sun. It had been several hours since they started the day, already well past noon. In a few more hours, the sun would set. Dirk spoke as he tossed the bag back to Garrett. We're a bit over halfway to the haven, but we only have around four hours until sunset. And going at the rate we are, we will need at least a week to gather enough crystals. We're only halfway. Seriously? Garrett blurted out at Dirk's assessment. Hearing this complaint, Dirk only turned to the boy. Garrett saw those almost apathetic eyes and shrunk back a bit. He wasn't sure, but over time, he had realized that Dirk might not be totally happy with his presence. He wisely decided to go quiet. Seeing this, Dirk turned away. Garrett and Kazma were the reasons they were moving slower. He got annoyed at them who kept complaining when they had no right to. Alec spoke up. Should we turn back? We're already halfway. The only reason we should is if you all can't handle fighting in the night. I don't think we can. Alec sighed. Not only will we have to fight at night, but the monsters are getting more plentiful and stronger. We can handle a couple at night, but not that many. I think we should go back. Then let's get going. As if he didn't care, Dirk turned and started walking. He agreed with Alec, but only in that they couldn't handle it. He was almost certain Garrett and Kazma would come out of the night burned to a crisp. As the sun started going down, the skinks retreated into their dens. This meant that the group came across fewer skinks as they walked back the way they came. However, the ones they did come across almost always came out of a fox hole, making it a rather thrilling hike full of surprises. Under Dirk's watch though, nobody got hurt. 
the only thing they had to deal with was the rapidly dropping temperatures after the sun went down. They had to walk in this frigid cold for a few hours before finally reaching the haven. The group was quick to pitch their tents and cuddle under their blankets upon entering the stone fortress, heading fast to sleep. The next morning, the group woke up a bit later than usual. This marked their third day inside the dungeon, and in total the fifth day since they left the capital city. After going through their morning routine, the group left the haven and began their normal hike deep into skink territory. Because of the direction they took that headed straight for the deepest haven, they almost never encountered other groups as very few intended to head there. And if they did, there was usually a tacit agreement to just maintain distance, the two parties keeping their separate paths. This allowed them to fight more skinks. However, on this day, they found fewer skinks than usual. It wasn't much less, but by the time they reach halfway into the day, they had only collected six mana crystals. Alec didn't really notice this fact though. He continued to lead the group into skink territory until they reached the time to make a decision. With Dirk as his clock, he realized that they were in the same dilemma as last time. They could try to push to the farthest haven, but that meant they would fight at night. While he had learned that the skinks retreated into their fox holes at night, he knew this was actually more dangerous than normal. Their previous night had been one of several ambushes, and it wouldn't have gone as well if they were to have pushed forward. Knowing this, he decided that it was best if they just didn't try to go to the farthest haven and turned around. The group was okay with his reasoning and followed. Dirk also didn't particularly care. They retreated all the way back to the haven, gaining another six mana crystals for a grand total of twelve that day. However, come the next day, Dirk began to notice something. On the fourth day, the group headed out like normal. They hiked through the dry desert dirt and bushes, fighting any skinks they came across. Alec then turned around at the halfway point and retreated, heading back to the haven where the group rested for the night. However, come the day's end, Dirk counted the crystals they had collected. The amount was ten, two less than the day before. The fifth day, Dirk counted the crystals at night again, coming up with nine. The amount they gained per day was decreasing. This was half of what they had gotten on the second day. They now had 49 crystals, and needed 91 more. At a pace of nine a day, they would need 10 days, and this was if the amount per day didn't continue to decline. Dirk waited to bring this up, going into the next day to see if things would get worse. And sure enough, when the sixth day came to a close, Dirk counted only seven crystals. The skinks were declining in population, obviously due to them. Finally, Dirk brought this up to Alec. Alec had also started to notice. Only encountering seven skinks through the entire day was alarming. And upon discussing it, he grew even more concerned. We need to change things up. Alec spoke. Right now, he and the group were gathered around their tents, eating rations. These rations were in fact some of their last ones. They would run out the day after tomorrow, forcing them to resort to eating skink meat. They pushed this concern to the back of their mind though as they listened into Alec. The number of mana crystals were getting decreases by the day. If this keeps up, we won't be able to reach 140 fast enough. I had originally planned for around 20 days, but I don't think any of us want to drag this out that long. So, if we want to move quicker we need to change what we're doing. We have two options. Alec put up two fingers. We can either search around other areas of the dungeon, or we can go deeper. However, I don't know if the first option is that viable. Why not? Garrett questioned, prompting Alec to speak in a low voice. The other groups. They have their own areas that they hunt in every day. We've claimed our own area too. If we start searching around, we'll be taking their kills. I was taught about these kinds of things, and I'm starting to realize that there are unwritten rules in dungeons. If we want to keep away from conflict, we can't encroach on other people's hunting zones. Alex spoke from the inferences he had collected over the past several days. Hearing him, Dirk thought about it and nodded. There were four other groups besides them in the haven, totaling five. They always ventured off in the direction of the farthest haven, while the others walked in their own directions. 
this formed zones where the groups would stick to, ensuring that they could all get kills and crystals. They had luckily stuck to their routine path, otherwise they may have gotten into a fight with another group. But this posed a problem. Their own zone was dwindling in skink numbers. After all, they killed everyone they came across. They needed a way to make up for this. With the other groups there, their only option now was to go deeper. So we need to go to the deepest haven. Ava spoke as the group made this conclusion. Alec nodded. It's our only option, unless we want to fight people. But going to the deepest haven won't be easy. Unless we pick up our pace, we won't get there before the sun sets. This means we'll have to fight a good amount of skinks in the night. Those skinks are stronger and more plentiful than the ones around here. I'm honestly not sure how well we can handle it. Alec went quiet. The group lowered their heads in contemplation. It was a risk, and they had to decide if they were going to take it. For the sake of completing their job faster, did they want to take on this challenge? Dirk looked around at everyone's pondering faces. If it were him, he would have been there already. But with the two pieces of baggage known as Garrett and Kazma, they were being held back. He figured they wouldn't want to take the risk since they had the highest chances of getting hurt. However, what they said surprised him. I think we should go. Garrett spoke up first with a smile. I'm tired of this heat, so if we can complete this job faster, we should. Hmm. I'm with him. Kasma nodded, feeling the same way as Garrett. She was building up fatigue every day, pushing her legs to their limits just to keep up with the group. She didn't want to stay here for a day longer. Plus, in the dungeon, while they had water, they weren't exactly able to shower or clean up much. Nobody was feeling clean or comfortable. It was a miracle they had stayed inside for as long as they did. Very well then. Our next goal is the deepest haven. However, I think we should exit the dungeon first. We're running out of rations, and we could use a day of rest to make sure we're in top shape. Yes. I like that idea. Garrett cheered at Alec's suggestion. Ava and Kazma also nodded. They wouldn't mind taking a day or two off at all. With that, the decision was made. The group left the haven the next morning, making their way out of the dungeon and back to civilization. Chapter 54 Normal Dirk's group exited the dungeon and basked in the cool, fresh air. Without wasting time, they made their way to an inn. It was already dark out since it had taken the whole day to cross the sand dunes to the exit, so not only were they tired, but dirty with sand in their clothes. Two rooms for two nights please. Alec paid for the inn, and upon getting the keys, the group rushed to their rooms. The girls shot toward the baths, as did Alec and Garrett. Dirk saw their eagerness and shook his head. Because of his body refining, he almost never sweat even under strenuous conditions. His skin didn't release many oils and dead skin wasn't any longer a thing. He felt about as fresh as the first day he stepped into the dungeon. The only thing he needed to wipe off was the small amount of sand that dusted his face. Other than that, he could be said to be perfectly clean. Not even other body refiners could maintain cleanliness for so long. This was a perk afforded to Dirk who had undergone skin destruction. His skin and hair were resilient and wouldn't dirty for long periods of time. Plus, his body was more resistant to changes such as temperature, so only if he pushed himself to his limit would he sweat and become dirty. Because of this, he didn't particularly need to shower. It would only be a matter of comfort. That night, everyone went to bed with a smile on their face. All except Dirk. Because they were planning on spending a few days outside of the dungeon, he decided to practice his enchanting. Specifically, the rune that he would need to plant onto his mana heart. This rune was a couple of steps above anything he had ever seen. Luckily, the book was detailed in its description about how to create it, so he merely needed to practice. It would take a while to successfully form, but it would happen. That night, he spent a few hours messing around. Using earth and metal mana, he drew runes in the air continuously. The rune he needed to make was comprised of many smaller runes that would both fuse together and cooperate together. Some runes oversaw the timing of the heart compressions, 
while others track the beat rate of the physical heart. Others would draw on the power of the mana heart to fuel the rune while some would monitor the cycling of mana through the blood. It was a surprisingly complex rune that ensured not only the beating of the mana heart, but its symbiosis with the physical heart. There were even some runes that laid the foundation for heart fusion in the future. These were easily the hardest ones to form. For him who had only just formed the most basic rune recently, all of this was exceptionally difficult. In the few hours that Dirk worked on it, he had failed nearly every rune he formed. There were dozens he needed to learn and form, but only one was successfully created. This was the easiest rune too. Naturally, it would take a long while to make all of them. But he advanced rapidly. While he may have failed almost all of them, he had gained many little pieces of knowledge that laid a strong foundation for enchanting. Usually, enchanters in training would be given systematic teachings in order to bring them up step by step. But he was jumping straight to the top, and by filling the gaps in himself, he was able to increase his natural ingenuity and attunement for enchanting. While it may not be the most conventional way to learn, introducing inconsistencies into one's general knowledge, it was definitely an effective practice for those that could actually make progress. Besides, the mana heart technique was one of the greatest techniques in the world. Naturally, the runes created by the technique's creator wouldn't be garbage. That person may have been one of the greatest enchanters of their time. Only someone that smart could create such a technique. If Dirk could form those runes, he could be said to be proficient in enchanting. Dirk had no qualms about how he went about things. He practiced until it got late, after which he finally decided to go to sleep. The next morning, everyone was slow to wake up. Because this was a day off, they indulged in their dreams until late in the morning. Dirk, naturally, wasn't one of those. He woke up bright and early. Despite going to bed late, he was refreshed as if he had gotten twelve hours of sleep. If he were on earth, he wouldn't be so energetic. But because he had trained mana, he could go without much sleep and still be well rested. After waking, he did a bit of mana long training as he dove into practicing the runes again. Because of his practice session last night, he had several ideas to try, and he was able to make even more progress than before. However, when noon came around and everyone woke up, he had only succeeded in forming one more rune. This was two out of dozens. He sighed at how long it would be before he completed everything. The group woke up and decided to get some food in a nearby restaurant. They congregated around a table and Alec ordered a whole platter to fill everyone up. Unfortunately, this cost more money, and the hopes for making any kind of profit from this job were dwindled down further. By this point though, Alec couldn't bother with that much. He had eventually shifted his mindset from making money to taking this trip as a way to gain experience. And surprisingly, he also had similar thoughts as Dirk when it came to Garrett and Kazma. Alec also felt that his porter and water mage didn't contribute much to this expedition. Over the week they had been inside the dungeon, Kazma had only been useful when it came to filling up their water bags. Only occasionally did she ever fight. All fighting had been left to Dirk, Alec, and Ava. However, Alec was different from Dirk in that he still accepted the value of a porter who could carry their luggage. Alec wasn't like Dirk who could so easily go with only a few items on him. He wanted his tent, his rations, blankets, and other necessities. This took up space, and if he had a bag to carry, it would inhibit his fighting ability to some extent. So, he appreciated having someone like Garrett. At the very least though, if Alec was able to stick with Dirk and Ava for another job, he would only bring a porter along. He didn't see a need for any more combat power as the three of them had proved to be more than enough. That day after eating, the group went and restocked on supplies. They bought enough rations to last them over a week as well as a few other convenient items. After that, they went to wander the town for a bit. Although this town wasn't nearly as glorious as the capital city, it was still a new place with new sights. Dirk and his group walked down a street in comfortable clothes. The only one armed was Dirk who carried a hidden knife strapped to his abdomen. They looked around, finding many street vendors who sold a myriad of items. Most of them sold food whose aroma and sizzling greasiness pleased the senses of passerby. 
others pawned off some items they had found. These items were mostly mana crystals, skink leather, and dune worm teeth. There were even vials of blood that some collected. Ava saw this and dove into thought. Blood was mostly used in alchemy, and she had learned some about it. Other than that, there were those who sold jewelry and even some who sold weapons and armor. Anything that a dungeon diver would take a fancy to was here. After all, this town was founded around a dungeon. It naturally catered to dungeon divers who brought in the money. After walking around some, Garrett and Kazma decided that they would take their own walk around town. So far, Dirk was the only one who knew about their relationship. However, Alec and Ava had their guesses seeing their behavior over the week. Their splitting off from the group for privacy was another giveaway. This caused Ava to think though. For several minutes, she pondered in silence as her, Alec, and Dirk continued to explore. Eventually though, she lifted her head. Sorry Alec, but I need Dirk for a bit. Oh? Alec turned to her, surprised. Dirk was also surprised. Alec didn't mind though, merely smiling as if he knew what was going on. Don't worry, you two go ahead. Thanks. Ava's face reddened a bit as she grabbed Dirk's arm and walked off. Alec chuckled as he walked in a different direction. Dirk followed Ava who walked in silence for a while. Since she had pulled him away, he intended to let her speak first. And eventually, she opened her mouth. Um, do you know why I got mad? She asked weirdly as they walked beside each other. Dirk's mind started to move as he pondered the question. Up until now, he truly hadn't understood what the problem was. He had only refused her repayment. As a friend, she didn't need to pay him for gifts he gave her. That was it. Dirk was a straightforward person and a straightforward thinker. That's how he had been raised. Where he came from, there were no friendly relationships and hardly any emotion. The only good relationship he ever had was with a grown man who had been his superior but also a father figure. And even then, there weren't any fluffy things like feelings to be discussed. But although he hadn't had any sort of emotional development back then, he could still learn. His own mother had introduced a sense of compassion, a sense of likeness for another person. And as his first friend, Ava was the recipient of this newfound sense of affection. He took care of her when she needed it. His giving her potions to heal from wounds he gave her was an example of this. But perhaps it was the heightened emotional presence within him that caused him to think of other things. He wanted to take care of her, but she also wanted to take care of him. Their feelings were mutual, and rejecting one side would lead to either conflict or separation. Dirk had eventually thought of these things. Normally, he would have thought them to be crazy. After all, he had never had anyone who wanted to take care of him like this before. But now, in this new life where he had a loving mother, and now a caring friend, he figured that it wasn't so crazy. Dirk sighed after thinking of these things. At some point, the two had reached a more barren part of the town, so he stopped walking. Ava stopped with him and turned to him. I rejected your kindness. Dirk spoke, a tiny bit awkward. Your first potion was made for me. You spent time and effort to make it so you could help me. Sorry for not realizing it sooner. No, it's all right. Ava sighed, suddenly feeling bad. She knew Dirk and how he acted. This shouldn't have gotten her mad, but such blatant rejection from him made her feel like he didn't think of her as a friend. It felt more like he was paying a debt. As Dirk thought, they were friends. It was supposed to be a two-way relationship. Ava spoke these thoughts. Dirk, you've given me a lot. You gave me your expensive potions, let me use and stay in your house, training, food, and treatment. And I... I feel like a parasite. I've basically given you nothing. And I know you don't want me to repay you, but I do. I want to give you something at least as a thanks. Or I wanted to try. But. I can't make any of those good potions. Alchemy is hard, and I wasted so many materials just to make that bottle of crap. I just. I hate how there's nothing I can do in return. I mean, who needs anything from a useless deer girl who can't mix some stupid plant juices correctly? 
Ava's fingers clenched as the corner of her mouth twitched. Dirk was surprised she started degrading herself. How hard had she tried just to get that single potion? Now he was feeling even worse for rejecting her hard work. After a few moments of anger though, Ava let out a long breath. She closed her eyes and shook her head. I just… I'm not mad at you. I'm sorry. I didn't want to make you mad, but I was mad and an idiot. Oh god, I'm such a bitch. Excuse me? S sorry. My friends say that word, and I'm basically the embodiment of it right now. Ava sheepishly covered her face before massaging her temples. Seeing her stress, Dirk sighed himself. It looked like she was placing a lot of pressure on herself. He felt bad, but definitely not as bad as Ava who was heavy with regret and shame. Dirk opened his mouth to speak, but Ava beat him to the punch. Hey, I know you're probably still mad, but I'm sorry. I don't know why I got mad when I did. I was just, frustrated. It's fine. Dirk gave a small reassuring smile. Sure he was mad, but he now at least understood the situation. In this world, there were many like Ava who bore the pressure of their families and expectations. She was just another young girl trying to do her best, and Dirk's lack of supportive understanding caused her to blow up a bit, especially when he was the one she wanted support from the most. She cautiously looked up at him. Are you mad? I was. But I know I'm not the most, normal person to have as a friend. It's not your fault. I should have encouraged you. No. I mean, sure you're not totally normal, but you're not that weird. That weird? W8, not like that. I mean, you're different, but in a good way. You know, you're really strong but you don't talk to, well, anyone. And that's not bad. It's just, you're not like Alec who everyone in the school is friends with because he's one of the strongest. But I don't care about that. You're perfect. I am not perfect. Dirk chuckled a bit. Being who he was, he naturally wasn't normal, and he never tried to convince himself that he was. But unfortunately for Ava, she had to put up with all his abnormalities. And while she liked him enough to do so, Dirk knew he could still frustrate her. Thinking of this, Dirk felt a bit crestfallen. He didn't enjoy frustrating his friend. He wanted to be more normal, but he had no idea what that meant or how to go about it. Seeing Dirk get a bit depressed, Ava became hasty. Hey, what's the frown for? Are we good now? Of course. Then let's hug. With enthusiasm, Ava rose up on her toes and wrapped her arms around Dirk. He felt the comfort of her embrace and couldn't help but hug back. The two stood there until Dirk raised his head and saw some other man who sneered at them from a short distance away. Dirk frowned and separated from Ava before pulling her arm and walking the opposite direction. He didn't want to be bothered when he was just now getting back in a good mood. Ava was confused as she was lead away but after hearing a chuckle she turned her head and saw the same man. Realizing what happened, she also frowned. Unfortunately, it didn't seem like that man intended to let them be. Hey kid! The man shouted, causing Dirk to stop walking. He looked back at the man with a mean gaze. The man chuckled sarcastically. Oh no, so scary! What's your name, little boy? None of your business. Ah. Come on now. I just want to get to know you better. Here, let me introduce myself and my friends. At that moment, two other people emerged from some alleyways behind them. Dirk's mind immediately went on high alert. Ava also realized something was happening. They were being targeted. I'm Gut, and these are Barsoul and Hurl. Hey kid, we've been a little tight on finances recently. You wouldn't happen to have any spare change would you? Gut spoke as he stepped forward, exposing the point of a knife from a pocket. Dirk moved Ava behind him. Ava herself started to panic. Unfortunately, this was on the outskirts of the town. They had come here for some quiet, but that meant there wasn't any nearby help. Ava had fought people before, but she had never been in a disadvantaged position like this. She wouldn't know anything about fighting someone with a knife while barehanded. 
her only solace was Dirk. When she looked at him, she could sense his emotions. His mind moved rapidly, but it was calm. His breathing didn't change, his heart rate didn't rise, and there were no outward signs of stress. The only thing she noticed was his gaze. It turned cold, apathetic. It was like he cared for nothing. It was like he turned into a puppet. Ava was slightly startled, but the slow, gradual approach of these robbers caught her attention. Seeing how Dirk didn't respond, Gut smirked. What's wrong little boy? We don't want to hurt you. We just need some money, and for you to never speak of this to anyone. How about it? Gut, I think he's too scared. He's paralyzed. The man Barsol chuckled as he saw Dirk's rigid body. The next moment though, Dirk's eyes turned to Gut. I'm not giving you anything. Turn around and walk away. Dirk spoke with a monotone voice. It didn't have a single hint of shakiness or commanding. It was as if you were merely informing them of a decision they had to make. Gut was surprised by his calm, but didn't think too much of it. He knew that Dirk Dungeon Dove, so he would naturally have some semblance of calm in the face of danger. He frowned at Dirk. Boy, don't push me. I'm sure you don't want anything to happen to that little girlfriend of yours. Gut took another step forward. Hearing him, Dirk felt anger well up within him. Kill him. An insidious voice echoed in Dirk's mind. He felt an urge, a sense of bloodlust. His hand twitched. Take out your money right now, and maybe I'll let you go. Gut moved even closer, coming within a few feet of Dirk. The other two also closed in, surrounding them. Ava shrunk back, feeling the anima inside her begin to activate. Being cornered like this, she felt her fight or flight response creep in. But Dirk didn't move, so she didn't either. Meanwhile, from afar, a pair of eyes watched this confrontation with curiosity. The eyes focused on Dirk and how he reacted. He, this kid isn't so bad. No wonder the big boss sent me to watch him. He's a real treat. Hopefully he can handle this little present I gave him. With a weird laugh, the pair of eyes hid away, moving to get a better view of the show. Chapter 55, Kill Dirk and Ava stood back to back. Ava waited for Dirk to do anything. She was surprised by the words that came out of his mouth the next moment. Touch her, and you will never see the light of day again. Dirk spoke with a frosty voice. Gut heard this bone-chilling statement, but instead of being intimidated, he got excited. Ha, ah, very well. Let's do it the fun way. With a maniacal laugh, Gut swung his knife. He only wanted to slash Dirk, hurting him, but not killing him. He wanted to see the fear on Dirk's face. It was easy to act tough, but all that broke down when one finally got a taste of real danger. Unfortunately, Dirk wasn't a normal kid. As the knife slashed through the air, threatening to slice his chest open, a voice spoke in his head. Engagement detected. Three threats determined. Killing order generated. Happy hunting. Slice. The knife came flying through the air. Gut frowned though when he didn't feel the familiar sensation of tearing flesh. He saw Dirk's body bend back, narrowly dodging the knife. The next moment, Dirk shot out his arm. His hand grabbed Gut's forearm that gripped the knife. Gut was about to rip his arm away when surprisingly, Dirk's grip remained firm. His hand was like a vice as it squeezed tighter and tighter. Dirk was activating his anima, and his strength rapidly increased. Arg! Gut growled as the pain became great. It felt like his arm was in the jaws of a monster. He jerked his body around, trying to escape his grip. He punched Dirk and even kicked, but was horrified to find out that Dirk's body was solid as a rock. Punching him hurt his own fist. He yelled, but was suddenly interrupted by a horrible noise. Crack! The forearm gave out, Dirk's hand clamping down. Gut watched as his arm was broken, and a wave of pain suddenly shot through him. Ah! He screamed as the knife was dropped. The other two, Barsol and Hurl, were shocked as they saw their friend cry out like a child. Hey! Both of them shouted and rushed over. 
Dirk threw Gut aside as he squared up to the two men. Both pulled out their own knives, Barsoul slashing toward Dirk first. Slice. The knife sailed, but was dodged. Dirk threw out his leg the next moment, slamming his shin bone into Barsoul's calf. Barsoul was thrown off balance, flipping to the ground. Ack! Barsoul grunted as surging pain came from his leg. Dirk moved on to Harrell. Harrell was quick to slash out with his own knife. However, he kept his balance and distance. Dirk dodged, but couldn't counter. This happened a few more times, Dirk maneuvering around the path of the knife every time. Then, Dirk found an opening. After Harrell slashed, Dirk moved in and threw out his fist, planting it in his gut. Harrell felt the wind shoot out of him. Though, this would be underestimating the power of the punch. Dirk held nothing back, and under his rank three strength, Harrell's organs were shaken. Thud. Ugh. Harrell could only collapse on himself. His stomach felt like it was about to explode, and he couldn't even keep himself upright. He curled into a ball, letting out miserable wails as blood seeped from his mouth and nostrils. By now though, Barsoul had recovered. He jumped to his feet, limping slightly from the pain in his leg. Seeing Harrell, he panicked a bit, but he had a knife that gave him confidence. He jumped at Dirk, waving his knife about in an attempt to cut him. Only, Dirk was too nimble, and all of Barsoul's movements were easily read. Dirk moved as if this were a choreographed dance. However, instead of finding an opening, he made his own. Spike Pillar Casting Spike Pillar Dirk gave a command, and his AI instantly picked up on it. A magic circle glowed on top of his hand. Barsoul saw this and realized Dirk was a mage. But he knew mages needed a casting time, so he wasn't worried as he closed distance to mess up Dirk's concentration. Unfortunately, this wasn't a normally cast spell. A second didn't even pass before the ground in front of Barsoul opened up. Since he had lunged forward, he was unable to dodge the long spike that surged toward his leg. Pooh! Ah! Barsoul screamed as the spike pierced into his thigh. The spike was tough, not breaking under his weight. And because he was abruptly stopped, his leg twisted around the spike, tearing the muscles. Dirk stepped forward to attack again, but suddenly, he heard a shout. Dirk! Ava's voice came from behind. He instantly turned and saw her backing away from Gut. Gut had a broken arm, but that didn't stop him from using his other arm to attack. He chased Ava, trying to cut her with his knife. Fortunately, she took it upon herself to evade, creating distance. Her anima training gave her quick movements not unlike Dirk's. Another thing that helped was Gut using his non-dominant arm. Seeing Gut attack Ava, Dirk felt his bloodlust surge. He lifted his hand, and two rock arrows instantly appeared above it. This was his instant casting given by the AI. Whoosh! One arrow flew out. Gut spotted this in the corner of his eye, but was baffled by how fast it moved. He attempted to dodge, but the rock arrow arrived too quickly. The arrowhead met the skin of his leg. Slice! Arg! Gut yelled as the arrow tore through his thigh. He fell to his knees. However, that wasn't the only arrow. He panicked as he saw Dirk bring down his other hand. Pooh! This time, the arrow impaled his side, piercing through and out the other. Gut felt blood seep into his mouth as his organs were torn through. He felt dread. Unfortunately, Dirk intended to let him wallow in pain. He turned to Barsoul who was pulling his leg out of the rock spike. He barely did so and fell to the ground, the hole in his leg spurting out blood. And no. Wait, please. You can't kill me. Barsoul cried out please as Dirk approached. From seemingly nowhere, Dirk had pulled out a knife. Barsoul felt his life slipping away as Dirk stepped closer. Unfortunately, Dirk didn't listen. Or, he didn't have the mind to listen. His eyes were apathetic, releasing no aura of threat. Inside though, he was surging with the desire to kill. Unknowingly, a black film extended out from his hand, covering the blade of the knife like a black fog. 
Barsoul had picked up his own knife and slashed at Dirk from the ground, trying to keep distance. However, with a well-timed movement, Dirk flicked his hand. Slice. Barsoul watched as his hand flew off, landing a few feet away. The cut was perfect, as if Dirk wielded the sharpest blade in the world. Dirk bent down, about to plunge his darkness-covered knife into Barsoul's chest. Barsoul himself had started screaming again, apparently in blood-curdling pain. Before Dirk could finish him though, he spotted Harel who had recovered enough to start running away in the corner of his eye. Letting out a small breath, Dirk raised his arm with the knife in hand. He then brought it down, throwing the knife with oppressive strength. The blade flipped as it sailed through the air. Harel wasn't looking back, totally focused on running. He was interrupted though by a burning sensation in his back. That burning sensation rapidly worsened, turning into an unbearable pressure as the blade tore open his lung from behind. Harel collapsed to the ground, unable to even scream. Dirk turned back to Barsol who continued to scream. Looking around, Dirk picked up the knife from Barsol's severed hand. No! Barsol pleaded again, but Dirk didn't hesitate. He smoothly plunged the knife into Barsol's neck, cutting off all sound. Kill count, one-third. He stood up as his AI rang out with a notification. He turned his head back to Harel. Since it had only been several seconds, Harel wasn't dead yet. He would die eventually though, so Dirk didn't bother with him as he shifted his gaze to Gut. Gut was still kneeled on the floor, arrow in stomach. He was suffering miserably. Seeing him groan, Dirk felt the corner of his mouth ever so slightly rise. He walked over. What was that you said earlier? You would hurt that little girlfriend of mine? Did you think that was funny? Did you think that was smart? Why must you threaten my friend? Dirk yelled, bringing back his leg and swinging. Bang! Arg! His leg slammed into Gut's abdomen, sending him tumbling. This time, blood poured from his mouth and nose. Dirk walked over, picking him up by his neck. You think I want to do this? I just wanted to have a nice little chat, but you had to interrupt me. Then you had to threaten me. I didn't want to hurt anyone anymore. I was fine with killing monsters but now you've forced me to kill people. Why? Dirk spat in Gut's face. Gut sniffled as he barely opened his mouth. We, were hired. Hired? Dirk's eyes zoned out hearing that word. It implied so much. Someone hired these three to attack him. He was being targeted. This wasn't random, but planned. But who would target him? He was just a kid from the academy out on a little adventure. He didn't even have money on him. His armor, the most valuable items he had, were in his room. If someone wanted money, they would go there. But they came to him. This person wanted to harm him specifically. He thought and thought, but nothing came to him. In this world, nobody knew who he was. This was a new life for him. He shouldn't be getting into any conflict with anyone. But now, conflict was coming to him. Why? This is another damn world. I know nobody here. I'm just some kid. Why am I being attacked? Dirk's mind became chaotic. Rage burned inside of him. He had escaped Earth, but now, the same problems were coming back to him. It was like he was a magnet for trouble. He thought back, remembering his conversation with that psychopath girl. The walking incarnation of bad luck. Was he really? He didn't want to believe it. Suddenly, his eyes zoned in. By now, Gut was choking on his own blood. Seeing this pathetic excuse for a human, Dirk gritted his teeth. His grip tightened around his throat. His arm raised, picking Gut up off the floor. Gut looked into those dark eyes of Dirk's, feeling the terror of death. Crack! Then, his body went limp. Dirk dropped him after crushing his throat, the corpse falling to the ground with a thud. Three kills confirmed. Threats eliminated. The AI spoke. Gut and Barsol had been personally ended by him, and Harel had already died from his broken lung. Three bodies lay on the floor, pools of blood spilling from all of them. Dirk? 
As Dirk contemplated, his attention was caught by Ava's voice. He turned to her. Ava was looking at him with a slightly horrified gaze. Dirk had mercilessly killed three people in front of her. Although they had threatened them first, she didn't expect things to devolve this far. Dirk wanted to explain, but now wasn't the time. Some people were already looking at them from afar. Dirk turned and walked to Haro's corpse, pulling out his knife. He then sheathed it before walking to Ava. She leaned back as he approached. He grabbed her hand. We need to go. Ava looked at Dirk for a second before lightly nodding. She let him pull her along, the two hurrying back to their inn. Upon arriving outside his room, Dirk pulled out his knife. He looked at the doorknob, seeing nothing out of the ordinary. All doors had a lock, so if someone tampered with it then he would notice. Grabbing it, he quickly twisted before shoving the door open and looking inside. He was greeted with nothing. He looked around at all his items, seeing that everything remained as it had been when he left. He sighed in relief and walked in. He went to go change his clothes which had gotten some blood splatter on them. Once he was changed, he sat down on a bed. Ava stood to the side, unsure of what to do. Sorry you had to see that. Dirk eventually spoke. Ava remained silent. She truly didn't know what to say. On one hand, Dirk had brutally killed three people in broad daylight. Killing monsters was one thing, but not only did Dirk kill three people, he did it so easily. It almost seemed like this was easier than killing monsters for him. She couldn't understand how he could take a life so easily. And then there were the things he said. Things about being forced to kill. While his words didn't initially seem odd, they brought up several questions. Did he already have experience with this? It was like he had escaped something, and this event brought him back. The disconnect between his words and what Ava knew about him baffled her to no end. She could only assume this was related to his secrets, the ones he couldn't yet tell her. She wanted to be scared. Simply seeing a dead person was shocking enough. To see them be killed was another level of trauma. But there were two things that comforted her. One was the fact that she had killed monster before. Humanoid ones at that. Sure people and monsters were different, but the experience of personally spilling blood and ending the life of a living thing introduced her to the concept of death, numbing her even if just a little. It made seeing the pools of red blood and lethal wounds on those three men less shocking. Second was the fact that Dirk was defending her. They had been surrounded by men with weapons, cornered with nowhere to escape. In that moment, she forgot she was a mage and a body refiner. She reverted back to thinking she was a normal person, with no power to speak of. She had placed herself on the same level as those men. But the truth was far from that. She was above them. Those men weren't mages, and they were barely body refiners. Ava surpassed them in every aspect. She could have killed them herself. But she didn't, and it was Dirk that stepped in to solve the problem. She thought to herself. Dirk was like her leader, her inspiration. She followed in his examples of strength. What he did, she should be able to do. She trained herself to be stronger mentally and physically. She had trained to be strong in the face of conflict. But as soon as she was faced with real conflict, she cowered. She left it to him to solve. If she were strong, like him, she should have been able to handle herself. Thinking this, she felt ashamed. But although she felt ashamed, she couldn't help but remember how scary it was to be faced with true danger. She had no armor, no weapons, no security. One stab, and her life would be threatened. In the face of that kind of danger, she felt helpless. Suddenly, she was overwhelmed with emotion. She felt anger. She was angry at herself. She was wrestling between fear and strength. She wanted to be strong, but the fear within her was powerful. And this was after she had told Dirk that she wanted to help him. It made her feel like a hypocrite. She couldn't help the tears that fell from her eyes. I. I should have helped. She let out a cry, causing Dirk to turn to her. I was stupid. I didn't help at all. 
I should have, but I was scared. I shouldn't have been scared. She yelled, but not at Dirk. Dirk frowned at her cries. Hey. He stood up, walking to her. She turned her head away. There was nothing for you to do there. Yes there was. There were enemies, and I should have fought them. No, you shouldn't have. Look at me. Dirk commanded. Ava barely raised her head, looking at him through the tears that blurred her vision. He spoke with a low voice. Those were people, not just some enemies from a dungeon. You have never taken the life of a person, and today was not going to be the day that you did so. Do not be mad at yourself for not solving a problem you should have never been faced with. I should at least have been able to solve it. But I was scared. And that's okay. After Ava shouted, Dirk shouted back. It's okay to be scared. Ava, you're a teenager. This is not something that you should be able to solve at such a young age. Then why were you able to? Because I'm not like you. Dirk's pupils contracted as his voice became rough. I've killed people before, Ava. I've done some very nasty things, and I've seen even worse. Ava I know you try to follow in my footsteps, trying to be strong. But this, this isn't one of those things you should be looking up to. Don't wish this bloody path upon yourself, and don't go hating yourself for being scared. Listen to me when I say that you did nothing wrong. Ava went silent, Dirk's voice echoing in her mind. After yelling, Dirk turned around and sat himself on the bed, calming his breathing. This series of events was getting him too riled up. Ava stood there, staring blankly into space. There was silence for almost a minute before Dirk spoke again. Ava, I know you want to be strong, but we all have our limits. This situation was beyond yours. Someday, you'll be able to hold your own and face those fears. But that day was not today. And that's okay. You have time. Please, don't be so hard on yourself. Let me handle these things. Dirk spoke almost pleadingly. From the depths of his soul, he didn't wish upon Ava what had been forced upon him. When he was put in a situation to kill or be killed, he was forced to kill. He was broken, then numbed, turned into nothing more than a killing machine. But after coming to this world, he realized how much he wished to stay away from such a life. He saw things from another perspective, and he realized how torn apart he had been. Now more than ever didn't want that for himself. He wanted the nice life that he had, with a friend and his family. Traveling the towns, killing monsters in dungeons, looting them for valuables that he could sell for money. These things seemed like the perfect way to go. It was a life of adventure and peace, one that Dirk had secretly come to love. But now, he had killed three people. This tore open old wounds that he thought he healed from and his friend was wishing that she were like him. She was mistaking his inhuman nature with strength. He wanted to correct that. He wanted her to know that it was okay to have the weakness she did. If she forced herself, she would develop a trauma. She would twist herself in her thinking. That wasn't courage, but derangement. Through his words, Ava could feel the plea. Suddenly, she was beginning to understand a bit about what his secret was. It obviously wasn't good, and she could sense the deep scars he kept hidden. More than anything though, she really wanted to trust him. Right now, she was a scared girl, a fact she hated but had to deal with. She wanted to rely on someone in the hopes of making things a bit less scary. So she put away her pride and made a decision, nodding her head. Okay. I'll leave it to you. Will you? Yes. Good. Thank you. Dirk sighed in relief. The next moment, Ava buried her head in his chest. He hugged and rubbed her back, comforting her as she cried a bit more, letting out her frustration and fear. Chapter 56, March After spending a little time comforting each other, Dirk and Ava left the inn. Dirk adjusted a few things before he left, memorizing their positions. After that, he and Ava moved through the streets. They needed to find their other party members just in case anything happened to them too. However, there were already some guards investigating the area. Three people being killed in broad daylight, 
while not a shocking situation, wasn't a normal one. Naturally it had to be looked into. And while this wasn't a city, there was still a small police force that maintained some semblance of order. A few squads of guards wandered the town, asking people what happened. Dirk saw this and frowned, grabbing Ava's hand and pulling her along. He watched the guards and stayed away from them while making sure to keep an eye out. His AI tracked the guards' movements as well, helping him move stealthily. Luckily the town wasn't that big. Dirk quickly spotted Alec who was looking around with curiosity. Not long after Dirk spotted him, Alec also saw the duo who walked toward him. Dirk! Do you know what happened? There are guards everywhere. Yes. Some people were killed. Killed? Seriously? Alec was surprised, his eyebrows raising. From what he knew, any fighting and murdering happened inside the dungeon where corpses could be eaten by monsters, wiping away evidence. It was very rare for people to do so in the town since it would draw attention to them. Dirk nodded. Yes. Do you know where the other two are? Garrett and Kazma? I ran into them a little bit ago. They should be that way. Let's find them. Dirk spoke before turning in the direction he pointed. Alec followed, able to guess what he was worried about. Not long after, the three found the two lovebirds. However, they were speaking to a guard. Dirk cursed inwardly before stopping in an alleyway, holding Alec back from approaching them. Huh? What's wrong? Alec questioned as Dirk's hand blocked his path. Dirk thought for a second before sighing. I'll tell you later. Okay? Alec's face was weird as he just let it be. After waiting for a while, Garrett and Kazma finished their conversation with the guard. After the two separated, Dirk walked over to them. Alec. Hey, have you heard what happened? There was a murder. Garrett spotted the group and spoke to Alec. Since he was a bit awkward around Dirk, he wasn't very inclined to talk to him in such a friendly way. Alec smiled a bit. Yeah, I heard. What did the guard ask you about? Dirk stepped in, questioning Garrett. He wanted to know what the guards were looking for. If he were caught, then it was possible he and Ava might have to leave. Garrett answered. He was asking us if we had seen anything. I guess two people had killed three men on the far side of town. Did he say what those people looked like? Ah, uh, not really. I guess one of them was a girl. They also said that one was an earth mage since there were rock spikes and rock arrows around the place. That was about it. I see. Dirk pondered, thinking about the chances of anyone being able to point them out. Earth mages weren't exactly rare. And since he and Ava were young, they weren't likely to be suspected. Only if someone had seen them specifically would they be in trouble. But it didn't seem like anybody had. Dirk didn't let anything show on his face as he came to this conclusion. He nodded. All right. Thanks. Sure. Garrett was confused, but didn't mind it. Everyone was curious about a murder. Dirk was just a little more so. Eventually, Alec spoke up. Okay, I think we've had enough fun for today. Let's go get dinner and prepare for tomorrow. We'll be going into the dungeon bright and early. Ugh, I'm not sure if I want to. Garrett groaned as he was reminded of why they were there. Hearing him, Dirk's eye twitched. That night, the group went to a restaurant. Turns out, nobody particularly cared about a murder and the place was as busy as always. The only difference was the amount of weapons on display. While a murder wouldn't deter anybody, nobody would let down their guard. Humans were just as dangerous as monsters, if not more so. Even more surprising though was the lively atmosphere. Everyone was armed and on guard, but this only seemed to increase the feeling of safety. Many people had fun without worry. After all, no one wanted to fight. They had enough to worry about in the dungeons. The next morning, Alec and his group members woke up early and geared up. They grabbed all their belongings and brought them downstairs to a table, taking inventory and double-checking to make sure they had everything. Once they were ready, they marched into the dungeon. 
they were immediately greeted with a wave of heat and dusty sand. This time though, they were more confident. They walked forward past the first haven, heading straight for the haven in the middle of the dungeon. They killed many dune worms along the way, collecting over a dozen earth mana crystals. All the crystals were tossed in the loot bag. As for other valuables like the worm teeth or blood, Dirk couldn't bother. The skinks were far more valuable, and he didn't want smelly items to stink up the loot bag. By nightfall, the group arrived at the Middle Haven. There were a few other groups there, most of them ones that had been here two days ago when Alex's group left the dungeon. It looked like it really wasn't uncommon to stay in a dungeon for long periods of time. The group set up camp for the night. However, they were all a bit nervous. It took a while for them to fall asleep. The next morning, everyone naturally woke up early, their nerves still getting to them. Today, they would have to make their way to the farthest haven. If it was just walking, they could make it by sunset easily. However, they would be fighting many skinks along the way. This took time, and every minute wasted on fighting skinks was another minute they would have to fight at night. Worse yet, they didn't have the stamina to move much quicker than walking pace. Dirk could jog his way there, but the others would collapse if they had to do that. Only Ava and maybe Alec could keep up. Garrett and Kasma weren't nearly as conditioned. Luckily, they had at least woken up early. By the time they were ready to go, the sun was barely risen. Dirk nodded, thinking how it would give them a bit more leeway. While everyone would be tired by the end, that was preferable to having to fight in the dark. They were quick to set off, the group of five exiting the haven and marching forward. They didn't look back, dead set on making it to the haven. They had to commit otherwise they would turn back halfway. Screech! As they walked, fire skinks blocked their way. Dirk was armed with his bow, and whenever he spotted one, he would shoot it. He coordinated with Ava as well, and she would rush over to finish the skinks he shot. Like this, enemies were made quick work of. This was only for the shallow area though. Once they went deeper, they encountered more resistance. At high noon, the group encountered groups of three. For these, Alec fought alongside Dirk and Ava. They would work to finish them as quick as possible. They couldn't spend too much time fighting or they would pay for it later. However, despite them moving quickly, Dirk didn't forget to harvest their target loot. He collected all the fire mana crystals, and due to his dexterous hands, he could pluck the crystals quickly. The loot bag slowly got fuller. Then, an hour after noon, they reached the halfway point. Dirk's AI kept track of the time and he realized that even though they had moved quickly, they would still have to fight in the dark. Luckily, they would only have to fight an hour after dark. That was only under the assumption they maintained the speed they were going at though. Dirk knew they would only face more battles, so the night would be long. Sure enough, they continued to encounter more skinks. As the temperature started to gradually drop, the group fought off groups of four skinks. Perhaps because she was feeling confident though, Kasma finally stepped up to fight with her water spells. Even if she had a hard time killing skinks, she could delay them until Dirk or Ava got to it to finish the job. Thankfully, this reduced the chances of anybody getting hurt. Dirk was mildly pleased, though he wondered where this fighting spirit was every other day prior. Finally, when the sun was setting, Dirk's group pushed farther in than they ever had. This is when they started seeing changes though. The number of skinks in each group actually got smaller. Normally one would be thankful for this, but Dirk wasn't. None of the group was happy about this. That was because the skinks only got stronger. Dirk was vigilant as he scanned the area around them. The group continued to walk at a brisk pace under the pink sky that turned the ground orange, all the while trying to keep their footsteps quiet. Dirk held his bow as his AI scanned for anything abnormal. Finally, he spotted a group. There were two skinks, but these weren't normal skinks. On all fours, they stood equal to Dirk's hip. Their bodies were several feet long. These skinks were massive, and Dirk could see their razor-sharp teeth whenever they opened their mouths. Their claws looked even more deadly. He frowned. After motioning for Ava to be ready, he drew back his bow. The skinks were about 40 meters away, 
but because they were so big, Dirk didn't worry about missing. Whoosh! The arrow flew, sailing through the air with surprising silence. However, it apparently wasn't quiet enough. The skink's head snapped to it just before the arrow hit. Luckily, despite spotting it, the skink couldn't dodge. Unfortunately, the skink was tougher than Dirk thought. The arrow barely pierced to the skink's hide. A small trickle of blood came out, and after a shake, the arrow fell off the skink. It was left with nothing more than a bad cut. Everyone saw this and had a bad feeling. Just this skink's durability was amazing. Those arrows were sharp, and Dirk had one shot killed skinks with them before. But now, it could only piss the skink off. Alec felt a bit of fear as he saw the pair of skinks turn toward them. Alec! Take the left one! Dirk shouted before running out. These skinks were tough, obviously a level stronger than the ones they faced so far. However, he wasn't too worried about their toughness. Blades, especially his hatchet, would still hurt them. What he was worried about was their fire. If their bodies were stronger, it was likely that their fire was too. Ava didn't have the resistance to fire that Alec had, so Dirk sent him ahead. Alec heeded Dirk's command, running forward to his enemy despite his apprehension. If he couldn't face this skink, then he wouldn't ever have the courage to become stronger and face stronger enemies in the future. Dirk rushed ahead first, meeting the skink head-on. As he ran, he saw the skink's throat brighten. He continued running while his AI chimed in. Casting Rock Wall a magic circle appeared above his hand. At the same time, the skink opened its mouth. Fire bellowed out. Whoosh! The surroundings were made brighter as a huge wave of flame surged forth. Normal skinks could only soot a tongue of flame. This was a step above. It was the difference between a single circle spell and a two circle spell. Dirk was only just beginning to learn those. Dirk's pupils contracted as he cast the spell. A wall of stone shot out of the ground in front of him. He planted his back against the wall. Flames washed around its sides. Dirk looked at the wall of fire to his right and left, feeling the heat. Not only was there a lot of this fire, but it was a level hotter than normal skinks. Dirk would have to bring forth all his mana to defend his body if he wanted to tank that heat. Fortunately, the fire didn't last forever. Right when the fire dissipated, Dirk flew around the side. A rock pillar shot out under his foot, throwing him forward to his enemy. Screech! The skink screamed as it met its enemy head-on. Dirk equipped his spear as the two got close. The skink swiped out with its claws. Dirk planted his feet and thrust forth the spear. The blade pierced into the skink's thick arm, causing it to howl in pain. He ripped out the spear, thrusting again. However, the skink skirted backward, dodging the strike. Dirk was forced to press forward, continuously thrusting out to try and hit the skink. Meanwhile, Alec fought his own skink. He drew his sword and ran forward, but like Dirk, he was hit with a wave of flame. Alec was forced to use his mana in defense while launching his own flame. The two flames fought each other, Alec splitting the skinks in half and mitigating the flame that hit him. Still, it cost plenty of mana on his end, and he couldn't perform that very many times. After the flames went out, the two charged each other. Surprisingly, because his enemy was bigger, Alec was able to wield his sword better. He always had trouble with small enemies, but big ones were right up his alley. Alec slashed at the skink's claws with trained movements, finally able to put his skill on display. He was able to put the skink on the defense just as well as Dirk did. The two fought their skinks, going back and forth between offense and defense. The skinks would breathe fire whenever they wanted their enemies to back off momentarily. While Dirk had an easier time defending with his strong rock walls, Alec had to consume lots of mana directly resisting it. But their victory was assured. Dirk didn't take long to severely wound his skink, driving his spear into its throat. After that, a few more thrusts and it was dead. He then went to help Alec, killing it quickly with a two-pronged assault. When the second skink died, Dirk straightened his back. He thought inwardly. What's the time? 
Total battle time, 4 minutes, 12 seconds. Damn. Dirk frowned at the time. These skinks were fast and tough. It took longer to hurt them at all, more so to kill them. That combined with their fire made the battles longer. While it would normally be acceptable, they were on a clock. Even now Dirk could see the sun getting lower. If they encountered too many groups, they would be spending a long time in the dark. Unfortunately, there was no turning back. Dirk quickly went over to the skinks with his knife. Because their hides were tougher, he had to cut away at the skin for a while before being able to pluck the mana crystal. When he collected both of them, he glanced at their size. These crystals were a bit bigger and had a stronger mana content in them. These were obviously a higher grade than the others they collected, but Dirk wasn't sure by how much. After throwing them in the bag, the group got moving again. Unfortunately, they were soon stopped by another skink pair. This time, Dirk didn't bother shooting an arrow. He and Alec charged head-on for the skinks, diving into another fight. This time though, Ava also joined in. Dirk had held her back last time so she could see how the skinks fought. Now that she knew how strong their fire was and how long their reach was, she had confidence in being able to help out. She was right behind Alec as the two charged forward. When the skink charged its fire attack, Ava pulled Alec behind her. Water wall. She brought her hand up and cast a spell she had already prepared. Right when the fire tumbled toward them, a large wall of cold blue water was created. The fire crashed into it, rapidly burning away the wall and turning it into a fog. But the wall held out. Just as 70% of the wall was burned to a vapor, the fire stopped. The two resumed their charge, Alec thankful to not have to burn his own mana to defend. Under both their assaults, the skink was cornered. It quickly sustained wounds from Alec's sword and when it got tired and unable to dodge, it was forced to take the brutal chops of Ava's axe. Once it lost one limb, the battle was basically sealed. Even its final breath of fire was unable to do much. Both of its enemies could independently block its fire. The skink let out a final cry, collapsing to the ground with blood pouring out of it. The dry ground was soaked with its blood. Screech! Right as Ava and Alec relaxed, they heard a horrible scream. They turned to Dirk who was fighting his own skink. Though, when they did their jaws dropped. Dirk was on top of his skink, riding it like a bull. In his hand was his hatchet that he buried in its body, using it as an anchor. His other hand held a knife that he continuously drove into the skink's eyes and throat. Under his ruthless attacks, Dirk's skink was quick to lose its life. It fell to the ground and Dirk climbed off its back only after plucking its mana crystal. Once he plucked the second, he spoke to them. Let's keep moving. Right. Ava snapped out of it, continuing their march. Alec took a little longer though. He couldn't seem to get the image of Dirk riding the skink out of his mind. How did he even get there in the first place? Chapter 57, Injured the group used brute force to take out any skinks in their way. Dirk made sure to keep everyone moving as quickly as possible. They never even stopped for water breaks, forced to drink while walking. This saved them precious time though. Soon enough, they were only seven miles away. However, this was also when the sun sunk below the horizon. The skies rapidly darkened, Dirk's face darkening along with it. Two hours, it could be worse. Dirk shook his head. They would be spending at least two hours in the dark to cover the last of the distance. However, this last portion held larger groups of powerful skinks. It wasn't long before they encountered a group of three skinks that stood as tall as everyone's hips. Ava, Alec, and Dirk were forced to fight one each. Garrett and Kazma continued to stay out of the way, their fear growing. They saw the surroundings brighten whenever a skink would let out its fire breath, and they worried about it attracting more enemies. Unfortunately, their worries were spot on. While Dirk fought, he spotted movement in the corner of his eye. There was another group of two skinks, and they were sneaking up to them. Seeing this, he let out a long breath. Suddenly, his movements became sharper, quicker, and hits harder. 
At the same time, rock spikes and arrows were summoned, hitting the skink in its blind spot and throwing it off balance. Dirk took the myriad of openings to land lethal hits. The skink's life quickly faded away. Then, Dirk flipped around. Above him appeared eight rock arrows. They split into two groups of four and then shot out into the darkness. Garrett and Kazma saw this and were confused. It was only when they heard that familiar scream that they realized what was happening. Dirk charged, attacking the two new skinks with ruthless acuity. He continued summoning arrows to hit them from above as he stabbed and slashed at them with his spear. When one of the skinks tried to divert its attention to the others, he ripped out his hatchet and threw it, wounding the skink in the back. Like this, he managed to hold the attention of the two skinks, gradually wearing them down. He would block fire with walls and bombard them from all sides. Right as Ava and Alec killed their skinks, Dirk was finishing off his two. They turned to Dirk, seeing him drive his spear through the skink's eye socket. After piercing the brain, the skink dropped dead. Dirk then turned and threw his spear like a javelin, landing it in the second skink's neck that was farther away. The others were surprised by his intensity. Like that, the battle was finished. Dirk retrieved his weapons before plucking the mana crystals. He couldn't bother speaking to his group as he pulled everyone along. They continued to trudge as the surroundings turned black, only the faint moonlight above them slightly illuminating their surroundings. Luckily, even in the dark Dirk's eyes worked just as well. This was his superior genetic construction at play. He continued to scan around for any movements, making sure no skinks got the jump on them. Unfortunately, because it was dark, the skinks had become stealthy hunters. They waited in their holes, and when Dirk's group walked by, they attacked. They didn't even bother launching their fire, meaning Dirk couldn't detect the heat fluctuations. They were ambushed, but Ava and Alec were able to respond quickly to the group of three that popped out. Dirk handled one with the same efficiency, killing it as quickly as possible. However, he underestimated how devious the skinks could be. One skink peeked out of its hole a few meters away. It overlooked the group, seeing the fights as well as Garrett and Kazma who stood around. It focused on them, slowly making its way over to the sitting ducks. Stray enemy detected. Damn. Dirk suddenly received an alert. He often flipped his head around so the AI could scan the place, making sure there weren't any other groups coming over. However, he instead spotted a skink that was only a small distance away from the two stragglers. He couldn't make it in time. He could only shout. Kazma! Behind you! Dirk yelled, startling Kazma. She flipped around, only to see a skink lunge toward her. Ah! With a shrill scream, she jumped back. Garrett also saw this and was stunned. The skink dove at Kazma who stumbled backward, reaching out its claws. Slice. The claws met skin, tearing it open. Kazma was stunned as she felt a stinging sensation in her leg. She fell to the floor, cold blood quickly pouring down her leg. Ah. Ugh. Damn. Watch out. Garrett shouted, dropping all the bags and jumping on the skink. He threw out his leg. However, the skink was quick and dodged, scurrying away. Garrett stood in front of Kazma, unarmed and fearful of the large monster in front of it. Suddenly, he could see the skink's throat glow. It was going to scorch them. Out of the way! Luckily, there was a shout at that moment. Dirk came running over, a large rock floating above his head. Pillars surged out from beneath his feet, propelling him forward like a projectile. Garrett dropped himself to the floor, guarding the panicked Kazma. Right as he did, Dirk came flying over. His hands came down. From above, the rock that was a meter wide came plummeting downward. The skink saw this and tried to back away despite being in the middle of letting out its breath. Unfortunately, Dirk aimed too well, and the rock came crashing down on top of it. Screech! The skink screamed as the rock crushed its side destroying one of its legs. It let out the fire that had gathered in its throat, burning everything in front of it. However, Dirk had already turned around. He re-engaged the enemy he was fighting previously,
quickly brute forcing his way forward and driving his spear into the skink's throat. This came at the cost of a claw to his body, but he had his armor to protect him. The skink quickly died. After that, Dirk came rushing back, leaving the spear in the original skink. He drew his hatchet, bringing it down on the half-crushed skink by Garrett and Kazma. It broke straight through its skull, killing it instantly. With that, both enemies were dead. Ava and Alec continued to fight theirs, the battles almost ended. Dirk went over to help them, wanting to finish things as quickly as possible. Finally, the battles ended as Dirk helped Alec and Ava kill the skinks. After that, Dirk went rushing back to Kazma. He kneeled down next to her, looking at her leg. Alec and Ava also came over. Seeing as Kazma had gotten hurt, Alec brought up his hand. Here, some light. He summoned a ball of light, illuminating Kazma's injured body. However, Dirk was quick to grab Alec's hand, forcing him to the ground and forcefully snuffing out the light. Do not light us up. You remember what happened in the Gremlin dungeon. After getting a face full of dirt, Alec wanted to get angry. But he remained quiet after realizing his mistake. He cursed his stupidity and just sat at the side. Dirk went back to checking out Kazma's wounds. He frowned. The wounds were deep. Those claws were long and sharp. They had gouged out her flesh and dug into the muscle. There were three slices that traveled from her quad to her calf, each one pouring blood and almost an inch wide. Dirk doubted she would be able to use her leg, regardless if she could take the pain. She would also suffer from blood loss if not treated soon. Ava, come here and hold her leg. Ack! Kasma grimaced as Dirk suddenly picked her leg up, raising her foot to the sky. Ava nodded and held her leg there. Kasma continued to groan, but Dirk disregarded it. He wanted to avoid blood loss. After that, he went to one of the bags a few meters away. He pulled out a tent and the supplies to pitch it. Once he spotted a rope, he grabbed it and went back over. Without a word, he wrapped the rope around Kasma's thigh above the topmost wound. Then, he tightened it with a knot. Ah dash! Kasma let out a scream, but Dirk quickly put his hand over her mouth, forcefully quieting her. She shook her head, but Dirk didn't let up. Keep quiet, unless you want to attract more skinks. Kasma glared at Dirk, but hearing him she could grit her teeth and bear the pain. When she stopped resisting, he removed his hand, letting her breathe normally. Meanwhile, Garrett watched at the side, feeling anger rise up within him. Kasma was just wounded badly, and Dirk was treating her like garbage. He couldn't help but speak. Hey Dirk, I know we need to be quiet, but take it easy. She's hurt. Excuse me? Hearing Garrett, Dirk turned his head. His eyes were frosty, causing Garrett to remember just what Dirk was capable of. Garrett gritted his teeth. I said take it easy. You can treat her a bit better. I advise you to walk away. Right now. Dirk responded with a low tone, his words threatening. He felt his anger come dangerously close to erupting. However, Garrett didn't seem to sense the threat behind his words. He frowned. No. I hack. Suddenly, Garrett's words were stopped as a hand gripped his throat. Dirk's fingers clenched around Garrett's windpipe. He stood up, Garrett in hand. Listen to me, very closely. His face came close to Garrett's. I don't care what you want. From now on, we're going to keep this very simple. You're going to follow my every command. If you insist on defying orders, then I'll leave you and Kazma here where you can fend off those lizards by yourself. Otherwise, if you wish to heal her and keep yourselves alive, you'll do as I say and stay out of the way. Am I clear? Dirk's dark eyes glared into Garrett's. Feeling Dirk's strength, he could only nod weakly as he struggled to even breathe. Good. Huh. Dirk dropped Garrett, causing him to inhale sharply. He coughed several times, his body trembling from both the weakness and fear overcoming him. Dirk turned and didn't look at Garrett again. Alec and Ava didn't interfere at all. Alec understood that Dirk was in the right. 
Ava obviously agreed with Dirk too. She was also feeling a bit of hate for Garrett. Although she knew he was merely a bad carrier, Garrett didn't do hardly anything at all on this expedition except complain, and now he was demanding Dirk to do things when he was only trying to help. This was basically biting the hand that fed you. If Dirk hadn't done anything, Ava was going to teach Garrett a lesson herself. Dirk went back to Kazma. Now, not even Kazma could look him in the eye. As he dressed her wounds, she didn't dare make a peep. It was only when he picked her up that she finally squealed in pain. The blood rushing back down her injured leg felt horrible. Luckily, because Dirk had tied off her leg, the wounds didn't bleed too much more. All right, we're changing plans. Garrett will support Kazma as we walk Alec, you're going to stick with them. Ava and I are going to walk ahead. We're going to maintain a large distance between ourselves. Ava and I will fight anything we see, and you trail behind. We should be able to avoid any more ambushes if you stay quiet and out of sight. If all goes well, we'll attract enemies and keep them away from you. Now let's go. Dirk spoke, and Ava took up a position by his side. Alec helped hoist Kamsa's arm around Garrett's shoulders. She winced as she took a step, but she could only bite down and push forward. With that, Alec stayed behind while Dirk and Ava moved forward. They separated by 100 meters, Alec barely able to see Dirk and Ava's figures. However, Dirk quickly lit a ball of fire above his palm. Like this, his body glowed a bit with an orange light. Alec nodded, able to more accurately follow. However, he was worried about Dirk acting as a beacon. That was Dirk's plan though. He would attract all the monsters to him, drawing attention away from the others. The reason he chose Ava as his partner was because she didn't use anything that would light up their surroundings while fighting. Alec often used fire to fight the skinks and that turned his battles into a light show. Dirk wanted to keep things less chaotic. He wanted to bring the monsters to him, but didn't want to attract the entire dungeon in the process. The two groups maintained their distance as they walked along. Alec frequently had to hurry Garrett and Kazma along as Dirk didn't slow down at all. While Garrett was angry about having to both carry bags and Kazma, he wasn't in the position to complain. He could also see Dirk's light get farther, and he didn't want to fall behind. Soon though, Alec put out his hand to stop them. In the distance, Dirk's light had gone out, and they could hear screeches. It was dark, so they could only make out black silhouettes. It was clearly a fierce battle though. And it truly was. Dirk and Ava faced off against a group of three skinks. Because they were the only visible prey, Dirk didn't have to worry about these skinks going anywhere else. He and Ava bounced between the skinks. She relied on her heavy axe and strong body to inflict serious damage with each chop. She got progressively better, able to control her movements more and develop a style of fighting. Dirk's skill was a given. He went between the skinks, constantly damaging them even if a little. He would move to one, and then suddenly turn to stab at another. If they were distracted, he would either hack them with his hatchet or impale them with his spear. And if they focused on him, that would lighten the pressure on Ava, allowing her to do more damage. Everything worked as he intended. Slowly, Dirk was figuring out that while monsters weren't intelligent like humans, they could be led along all the same. He could use their lack of intelligence to grasp their basic instincts, forming an optimal fighting pattern that ensured his victory. He would read their every reaction, and they wouldn't even realize they were being played within the palm of his hand. Such combat sense was what allowed Dirk to survive and become one of the most lethal fighters on the planet Earth. While combat sense could be gained through experience, only the best talents could develop their killer instincts to the highest degree. Dirk had spent most of the past 14 years of his life as a child that did nothing but train. His instincts had been worn down. But now, he could already feel it coming back. It filled him with a strange sense of euphoria. Splat! Dirk's hatchet fell down upon a skink's neck like an executioner. The neck was wide, so only half of it was chopped through. But that was enough. The skink collapsed without life. He moved on to the second skink while Ava finished the third. Soon, all three had been killed. 
Dirk and Ava stood in the darkness, their breathing strong but controlled. They suddenly looked at each other, and Ava smiled. For some reason, she felt great. Fighting with Dirk like this made her feel fuzzy on the inside. She chuckled a bit, though made sure to keep it quiet. Dirk saw that and couldn't help but smile himself. The next moment though, he frowned. He found himself enjoying dungeon diving and killing monsters, but he knew that on the outside, he already had enemies in the dark. He wanted to start a life where he could just do this all the time, but now that might not be possible. He felt anger at the one who wanted to cause trouble for him. He also had a bad feeling about everything. Eventually, Dirk shook his head. Right now, he had to focus on making it to the haven. After lighting a small ball of fire in his hand, he continued walking, Ava glued to his side. Alex saw the fire from afar and was relieved. He beckoned Garrett and Kazma. Like that, the group continuously made their way deeper and deeper. Dirk and Ava encountered several more groups, most of which ambushed them from foxholes. However, they were able to respond well. Ava felt her senses be heightened, and not only did her combat proficiency rise, but her magical ability progressed as well. Using spells while under stressful situations helped one learn how to better cast them. It would get to the point where she would merely have a thought, and the spell would appear. While that would only happen at higher tiers, everyone had to start somewhere. This was the best training. The group continued for a bit less than an hour. They only had another hour or so to go. However, at this time, Dirk heard a faint thud in the distance. Turning back, he saw that Kazma had collapsed. Chapter 58, Pain Shit! Dirk cursed as he turned back, Ava quickly following him. Under the cover of darkness, he rushed to Kazma's side. Dirk disregarded the panicking Garrett as he began undressing her wounds, swiftly taking off the bandages. What he saw was alarming. Despite having tied off her leg, the bandages were soaked. Dirk threw out the bandages before looking at the wounds again. Don't tell me. Dirk felt a bit of concern as he observed the wounds. He suddenly spoke. Light. Make it dim. Oh. oh. Hearing this, Alex stumbled before bringing out his hand, forming a ball of faint light. With that, Dirk could see more clearly. He used his AI to scan the wounds. Scanning. Both the AI and Dirk looked at the wounds. Dirk was unsympathetic as he used his fingers to slightly spread the slices. This caused Kazma to squeal in pain. He disregarded her discomfort and observed the wounds around her thigh. The wounds continued to drip blood. This much would usually seem normal, but Dirk found it worrying. Sure enough, he didn't receive good news. Warning! Arterial rupture detected. The AI let out an alert as it highlighted a section of the wound, making Dirk's face turn grimmer. A broken artery was lethal, especially after they had traveled for a long time. No wonder the bandages were soaked. Dirk hadn't seen this before since they were trying to move quickly. His top priority was to keep moving lest more skinks converge on them, otherwise even Garrett would get hurt, and that would increase the chances of someone dying. But now the situation was bad. Dirk looked at Kazma, grabbing her wrist and feeling her pulse. Her heart rate was faster, but it was also weaker than normal. This meant she had lost a lot of blood. Alec. Dirk finally opened his mouth. Use all your healing power on her leg, right on the thigh. Do it now. All right. Alec was panicked as he dispelled the light and kneeled down next to Kazma. He placed his hands on her thigh, using his healing ability. Kazma's thigh glowed a bit, Alec's light element streaming into her. He concentrated it on the thigh as much as he could. And for the most part, it stopped the bleeding. Some of the more shallow areas even scabbed over, beginning the healing process. He did this until he used all the energy he could. He stopped as a splitting headache overcame him. With that, Dirk looked back over the wounds. It looks alright, wait. On first glance, it looked like Alec had solved the problem. However, after Dirk summoned a fire for light, he could see a dark purple spread around the wound. This wasn't a normal bruise. 
Damn. Dirk cursed as he saw swelling. Suddenly, everyone saw him take out a knife, he put it up to the recently healed wound. Slice. Garrett was shocked as Dirk cut the wound back open. When this happened, blood came pouring out. Dirk confirmed his suspicions. The artery hadn't been healed by Alec. Kazma could only shudder under the pain he kept causing. Well, we're doing this the hard way. Ava. Yes. Ava rushed to Dirk's side. Hold down her arms. Don't let her move. Okay. Ava unsurely nodded her head. She moved to Kazma's head, grabbing her elbows and holding them against the floor. Both girls felt a foreboding feeling come over them. Good. Now, you. Dirk suddenly turned his gaze to Garrett. Garrett was startled as he met Dirk's apathetic eyes. If you do anything and try to stop me, just know that she may die. You're going to stand to the side and do nothing while I handle this. If I hear any demands or yelling, then I'll leave you both here. She'll die within the hour, and you'll die to the lizards. Am I understood? Garrett was shocked, but then gritted his teeth. He knew that Dirk was helping Kazma keep her life, but now his hate had gone beyond him treating her harshly. Garrett simply didn't want to listen to him at all. With this threat though, he could only nod his head despite how much he wanted to punch Dirk in the face. Seeing this nod, Dirk turned back around. No matter what, Garrett couldn't do anything to him. Everything from Kazma's to his own survival was up to him. If he could muster the self-control to keep his mouth shut, then they would get through this relatively fine. Dirk turned his attention back to Kazma. He took off his armor as well as his shirt. After putting the torso armor back on, Dirk took the shirt and used it as a rope to tie it around Kazma's mouth. This would act as a gag as well as something to bite down on. Then, after resting some of his weight on Kazma's uninjured leg, he took out his knife again. His hand came up to the blade, creating a ball of hot fire. This fire heated the blade until it was red hot, glowing obviously in the dark night. Everyone who was watching felt their hearts sink. They didn't want to believe their speculations. Ava, do not let her move. Keep her pinned. I don't care how much she struggles. Understood? Yes. Ava barely nodded as Dirk reiterated himself. Dirk then turned his gaze to Kazma who looked at him with fear in her eye. This'll hurt a bit, but it'll end quickly. With that, Dirk moved the knife. The red-hot blade approached the wound where blood continued to stream from. It touched. T-S-S-S. Arf. Kazma let out a guttural roar as her entire body jolted. The red-hot knife seared her flesh like it was meat on a skillet. Dirk was merciless as the knife pushed deep into the wound, truly searing all the flesh around it. Garrett watched this, his face horrified. He wanted to tackle Dirk, but barely held himself back. He just stood in place in shock, watching as he burned his girlfriend. Meanwhile, Ava used her strength to keep Kazma pinned. Dirk also put his free hand over Kazma's mouth, stifling the yells that the gag didn't muffle. Thankfully, the process didn't last long. Dirk removed the knife after several seconds. Taking a look at the wound, not only had the bleeding stopped, but there was no swelling. The artery had been sealed. Dirk let out a light breath before plunging the knife into the dirt to cool it. After that, he grabbed some more bandages and wrapped Kazma's leg again. He also untied the rope that was cutting off circulation. He didn't want to harm her entire leg. After the knife was removed, Kazma continued to groan, tears streaming from her eyes. That pain was truly horrible. She never even knew she could feel such pain. After tending to the wounds, Dirk untied Kazma's mouth before standing up and letting her be. There was no way he was moving Kazma right away. He could only let her rest a bit. He scanned around and stood guard. The group was silent for around an hour as they sat around. Kazma eventually quieted, the pain in her leg turning to a horrible ache. At that time though, Dirk spoke. We're not resting here. Prepare to keep moving. His words went into Kazma's ears like those of a devil. Garrett was also shocked. 
How could they move in this condition? You. We can't stay here. Not all skinks are asleep. We're sitting ducks if we get caught, and I might not be able to protect you in that case. We have a couple hours to the haven, after that we can rest. Hearing Dirk, Garrett couldn't refute. Kasma couldn't even stand by herself, let alone put up a fight. If a skink got to her and he couldn't do anything about it, then there was a high chance she would die. Even Alec was unable to fight for a while after exhausting his strength. Only Ava and Dirk could fight, and the part of the dungeon they were in had groups of four skinks. Let alone Kazma, even he might die if the situation took a wrong turn. He kept quiet. Seeing that, Dirk turned and bent down next to Kazma. He scooped up her torso, making her sit before standing her up. She shuddered as waves of pain flooded her leg alongside her blood flow. Alec, get up. Dirk spared nobody, calling on Alec as well. Alec had a headache, but his body was still full of energy. He had Alec take his spot under Kazma's arm, disregarding how much pain he was in. Alec could only grit his teeth and push through the headache. He couldn't exactly complain in front of Kazma. After Garrett supported Kazma's other arm, Dirk nodded and walked off. Ava was right next to him as they took up a position far away. Like this, the group continued moving as they had before. Now though, Alec and Garrett basically had to drag Kazma. With their strength though, such a thing was easy. They moved slower than Dirk thought, but trekked forward well. Dirk and Ava fought quite a few groups of skinks as they walked for two and a half hours. At that time, Dirk finally spotted a large fortress. Beckoning everyone over, they all hurried into the haven. Upon entering the building and finding an open space, Kasma was carefully laid down. After finally getting to rest, she cried a bit before quickly passing out. Everyone else was too tired to notice this besides Garrett. After unpacking blankets, Alec, Ava, and Garrett were quick to fall asleep as well, not bothering to pitch their tents. Dirk, on the other hand, went back to Kasma. As everyone was asleep, he placed a bag next to her body. He then woke her up with some cold water. Ah! W what? Kasma panicked as she was startled awake. When she saw Dirk though, she went quiet. After that, weakness came over her. Her body had lost a lot of blood, and she couldn't even lift a finger. Her fear of Dirk also compelled her to not resist. Sorry to wake you, but you can't sleep just yet. Eat this. Dirk sat next to her hand put out a piece of bread. Kasma was confused but didn't disobey him. She weakly accepted the bread, nibbling on it for a while before finishing it. After that, Dirk kept handing her food, mostly dried meat. Meat had protein and nutrients that Kasma seriously needed in order to heal. He forced her to eat and drink water until she was completely full, only then allowing her to go back to sleep with the promise that she wouldn't be awakened again. With that, she passed out once more. Dirk also made himself a bed. However, he didn't go to sleep. Dirk had noticed, but they weren't the only group there. There was another group that had been roused from their sleep by Dirk's group's entrance. They had watched them before going back to their tents. However, with his group in the state it was in, Dirk wasn't about to expose a weakness. He sat alongside some of their bags, facing the other group's tents with a vigilant gaze. Dirk was especially wary after having been attacked in the town. While he knew that these people probably didn't pose any threat, he didn't want to take chances. He sat there for the entire night. During that time, he didn't just stalk the other group, but also practice his enchanting. He kept working on the rune he needed to form, gradually consuming his energy as he tried dozens of different formations. Several hours later, the sun began to rise. However, none of Dirk's group awakened. Dirk, on the other hand, had never gone to sleep. He watched as light gradually filled the haven. Finally, he saw the other group rouse from their sleep. They piled out of their tents one by one. Naturally, they were curious about the newcomers. When they glanced over though, they only met Dirk's blank gaze. While he didn't watch over them like a hawk, his blatant vigilance made things a bit awkward. 
the group eventually ignored him as they went on to cook some food. After an hour or so, they all wrapped up and put on their gear, preparing to leave and hunt. At this time, one of the men in the group split off and walked in Dirk's direction. Seeing this, Dirk stood up. Hey kid. The man who looked around 18 years old approached. Dirk just nodded. We're about to leave. We plan on leaving our items here since we're the only ones who come this far. I hope we come back to our things the way they were before. The man spoke with a threatening smile. Looking at him, Dirk could sense a very real combat ability from the man. However, he wasn't phased. He maintained his blank stare, just looking at the man as if he were some average, random person not worth paying attention to. I have no interest in your things. Dirk spoke plainly before sitting back down in his seat. Seeing this blatant disregard, the man felt a tinge of anger well up within him. He turned with a huff. Good. I hope for your sake that's true. With that snark, the man walked away, meeting with his group before walking out of the haven. The man was in a group of four, two men and two girls, and the other three glanced at Dirk before leaving. Dirk watched them leave. He truly wasn't interested in their things. They likely took their loot with them regardless of whether there were people or not. Either way, he wasn't one to steal things just because he could. After that, Dirk continued to practice his enchanting. Through the night, he had succeeded in creating another rune. This would make just about four runes out of the dozens he needed. It was also one of the easy ones, but he was making steady progress toward the harder ones. The gradual increase in skill would ensure that he could tackle the hard runes when he came to them. After a few hours though when the sun had already risen above the horizon, Dirk heard rustling near him. He turned to see Ava waking up. She pushed herself to a sitting position before taking a minute to remember where she was. Dirk? Right here. Oh. Good. Ava let out a breath when she found Dirk. All the previous events of the night came back to her at that time. She was silent as she recalled everything that happened. It was truly a bit shocking. If it weren't for Dirk's odd familiarity as to how to handle Kazma's wounds, she probably would have died. It was only now that Ava was realizing this oddity, but because this wasn't the first time Dirk had shown such skills, she didn't worry about it much. She was only thankful. How's Kazma? We should probably check her wounds. No, let her be. When she wakes up we'll check them. Dirk shook his head. Unfortunately, without the supplies of an actual hospital, there wasn't much they could do for Kazma. Dirk didn't have any cleaning supplies, splints, stitches, numbing agents, or anything else he would need to properly mend her wounds. The only thing he could let her do was rest and let her body recover some strength. That was the reason he fed her so much food the night before. Oh. Ava nodded to him. After rubbing her eyes, she moved over to the pile of bags that comprised his bed. When she saw that he had no blankets, she frowned. Aren't you cold? How'd you sleep last night? I didn't sleep. Huh. Ava turned to him in surprise. At all? I was keeping watch. There was another group here. So? How could you not sleep? Relax. Since you're up, I can sleep now. Dirk sighed as he shifted, laying flat and using the bags he was leaning against as a pillow. Once he was comfortable, he closed his eyes with his head facing the ceiling. Ava watched him as his breathing became shallow and his face relaxed. Thinking for a second, she got up and grabbed a blanket, laying it over him. He was still only in his armor. After that, she sat next to him, watching his face. She subconsciously combed her fingers through his brown, wavy hair, straightening it out. Dirk never let his hair get so long that he could put it into a ponytail, but he still maintained some length. To Dirk, perhaps this long hair was a symbol of defiance. He always had to keep his hair short on earth, but with his newfound freedom, he could let it get as long as he wanted. Chapter 59 Safe after a mere four hours, Dirk began to wake up. By now, it was already a bit past noon. Turning his head, 
Dirk found that the rest of his group had unpacked and were lazing around, enjoying a day of recovery. Last night, while Kazma was the only one hurt, the rest had been mentally exhausted. Dirk took a few seconds for his body to adjust before standing. The rest of the group saw him. Ava and Alec were glad to see him wake. Garrett and Kazma though were not. The first thing Dirk did was walk over to Kazma. She was laying against a pile of bags, and when Dirk approached, she shrunk back into them. Garrett frowned as Dirk knelt down next to her. Have you taken them off? And no. All right. Let me see it. Kazma was nervous as she let Dirk do as he wanted. Dirk lifted her leg a bit and unwrapped the bandages. There was a bit of red, but thankfully not much. Kazma winced as her wounds were exposed to the fresh air. Her heart rate sped up as Dirk took a close look at the wounds. He was silent as he seriously examined them. The wounds were still open, and unless they got stitched up soon, she would be left with horrible scars. As it was, they would leave behind bad scars anyway. Dirk checked to see if there were any signs of infection. After seeing how clear the wounds were though, he was surprised. It was as if they had been cleaned out perfectly. The only thing that could have done this was Alex healing since they didn't have any medical cleansers. Dirk was pleased by this. It would make his job easier. After seeing that the wounds were as good as they were going to get, Dirk put up his hand and planted it on Kazma's forehead. She looked at him oddly as he felt her temperature. Are you feeling sick? Dirk asked. Hearing him, Kazma was a bit surprised before nodding timidly. Why yes. You have a fever, and a headache I'm sure. Your wounds are clean, so there's no risk of infection. But bacteria still got into your system, and your body is tired from healing itself. You'll feel bad for the next couple days until your body fights the sickness. We still need to get you to a doctor though. Alec. Yes? Hearing his name be called, Alec responded. Dirk waved him over. Use your healing power on her, as much as you can. After that, we need to pack up. We're heading out in an hour. Heading out? Shouldn't we rest? Alec couldn't help but ask. Despite so many things going on, Dirk kept them moving. He wasn't even letting Kazma rest for a day. Dirk shook his head. Kazma needs to get to a doctor as fast as possible. Her life isn't in danger, but her wounds need mending, and she's only going to get sicker tomorrow. We need to move before she can't. The sooner we get her out of here, the better. Plus, I'm sure she probably doesn't want hideous scars on her leg for the rest of her life. Dirk explained, throwing in one last incentive to keep moving. Hearing him, Kazma frowned. She really didn't want hideous scars. She was supposed to be an elegant mage, but she couldn't do that if she had scars running down her entire leg. Heal her, and start packing. We leave in an hour. After Alec didn't say anything, Dirk reiterated himself. Alec only nodded before moving over to Kazma. After he was done, Dirk wrapped her leg back up before beginning to pack. By the end of the hour, the group was packed and ready to go. Alec's job was supporting Kazma, while Garrett took up his position as a bag carrier. With that, the group left the haven, stepping out into the blazing sun. As they walked, Dirk and Ava were responsible for holding off the groups of skinks they encountered. If any got past them, it was up to Alec to muster up his physical strength and hold them off. Throughout the walk, Dirk constantly had Alec use his healing power on Kazma. Because of this, Alec constantly had a horrible headache, but Dirk still forced him to fight occasionally. This was a form of training, and Dirk didn't mind being harsh on Alec. Like this, several hours passed. The sun eventually set, shrouding the desert in darkness and cold winds. The group continued to march in this darkness, but unlike last time, they had it easy. It only took a few hours to get out of the danger zone where the skinks had high strengths and numbers. After that, Dirk and Ava merely had to fight stray skinks that couldn't even scratch them. These skinks were only half the size of the big ones near the furthest haven, so naturally they went down quicker. Ava was surprised about how easy they were to kill, 
but she knew this was because she had been fighting the hard ones. Her skill had increased significantly. By midnight, the group finally made it to the central haven. It was here that Dirk let them pitch tents and sleep. Come morning though, he had them set off even earlier. By now, his words had proven correct. Kasma had gotten even sicker. She would sweat even in the cold, and her entire body was weak. Alec felt bad and did his best to support her. Dirk was entirely unsympathetic though as he forced them to keep moving. At the end of the second day, they thankfully made it back to the first haven near the entrance. Dirk didn't let them stop though, and they pushed through to the exit. By the time they passed through the dungeon entrance, it was already late at night. We're taking her to the doctor. Dirk spoke as they emerged into the town. The dungeon association had a hospital next to it, so he went straight for that. In this town where most of the inhabitants were dungeon divers, it was impossible that there wouldn't be doctors capable of healing. Sure enough, one of the few buildings with a light still on was the hospital. Dirk's group walked into it, immediately seeing rows of beds, half of which were occupied by injured warriors or mages. Yes? Can I help you? A doctor was quick to spot Dirk, calmly walking over. This doctor was a buff man wearing a brown apron, on which were plenty of bloodstains. Dirk pointed to Kazma who was being carried by Alec. She was scratched by a skink and doesn't train anima. Well, that tells me everything I need to know. Come. Hearing Dirk, the doctor immediately understood what happened. He waved them over, guiding Kazma to a bed where she was laid down. The doctor saw her feeble appearance and bandages on her leg. He skillfully unwrapped her leg, taking a look at the wounds. H.M. The doctor's face was neutral as he looked over the wounds. There were four slices that went from Kazma's upper quad to her calf, tearing through her flesh. The deepest wound was a couple inches deep. It was here that the doctor focused. Right here, this should have struck a vein. Who cauterized it? Upon seeing Dirk's handiwork, the doctor asked. I did. You? The doctor turned to Dirk, a bit of surprise on his face. He nodded approvingly. Well, good job kid. You saved her life. Without sealing that vein, she would have died of blood loss. Good job cutting off her circulation too. I can see those rope burns above the wounds. Whoever taught you this stuff did their job well. The doctor praised as he continued examining the wounds. Hearing him, Kazma and the others were surprised. When Dirk had seared Kazma's wound, he hadn't explained exactly what he was doing. He had only explained that he needed to do what he did or she would die. At the time, Garrett didn't believe him, but perhaps because of Dirk's direct confidence, he was able to keep himself in check. Dirk had shown skill and knowledge, so at the very least, he knew Dirk wasn't trying to kill her. Even Alec had been skeptical. But hearing it from a doctor, they were enlightened. The academy didn't teach them everything, but basic biology they did. Especially as it pertained to wounds from dungeon diving. There were major arteries that would cause the person pour out blood like a fountain if struck. If these wounds weren't handled quickly, these people would die of blood loss. Thankfully, Dirk had known what he was doing and acted quickly. Without him, Kazma wouldn't have survived the night. It was only now that the group understood this. All right, with you having sealed everything, and with the help of whoever is the healer in your group, I only need to stitch her up. Services don't come free though. If you want her to be numb during the stitching, then this'll cost about 30 gold. If you can't pay that, then it's 4 gold. 30 gold. The group frowned. 30 gold was a lot. It was clear that the majority of the cost came from the numbing agent. On this trip, the group had already spent a lot. By now, they weren't sure they would break even on the costs after they got paid for the job. That was even if they could complete the job now. Regardless, this was yet another significant expenditure. The bigger problem was though, they didn't have much gold on them. Sure they were all nobles from Golden Spoon households where 30 gold wasn't much better than a silver coin, but Alec had only brought a small stash of money with him. On top of all the other expenses, they didn't have much left. When he grabbed his bag, 
he frowned. I have twenty gold. Hearing this, the others felt their heart drop. Without thirty, Kazma would have to get stitched up without the numbing agent. The doctor also heard this, but he wasn't so anxious. If you guys can't scrounge up the money, then I recommend putting some of it toward alcohol. If you get her drunk, the pain will be much less. Most of the dungeon divers here do that instead of paying everything. Drunk? Kazma gawked, as did the others. This idea seemed ridiculous, but on second thought it wasn't. It truly would work, only Kazma would have to pay the price of a hangover the next day. That on top of her already weak and sick body would put her through a lot of extra pain. No matter how this went, she would suffer greatly. After thinking for a while, Alec was about to agree and go grab some alcohol from one of the taverns nearby. However, at that moment, Dirk rummaged through the bags Garrett was carrying. After a few seconds, he pulled out a large sack. Clank. He dropped the bag on a nearby table. It hit the table with a hard sound. There are a bit under 100 mana crystals in there. That should cover the rest of the cost. Oh? The doctor's eyebrow raised before he opened the bag. Inside he found earth mana crystals and fire mana crystals. The earth mana crystals were only grade 2, and they had come from the dune worms. The fire mana crystals were a grade higher and came from the skinks. The doctor seemed familiar with this mode of payment as he rapidly calculated how much the bag was worth. He soon spoke. This bag should cover about 23 gold. Give me 7 gold and the cost is covered. Done. Dirk readily agreed, grabbing 7 gold from Alec's bag and handing it to the doctor. He nodded as he transferred the loot to another bag and pocketed the gold. At the same time, Kazma was looking at Dirk with a conflicted face. He so easily gave away all their loot just to pay for her treatment. This image of him contrasted with his seemingly heartless treatment of her in the dungeon. I'll get working then. I'll have to ask you to leave in the meantime. In about an hour, you can come back. With that, the doctor waved them out before mending Kazma's wounds. The group walked back into the cold night air, their moods downcast. The group was silent as they stood outside for a while. At this point, Garrett couldn't find it in him to say anything. He couldn't even lift his head to say thanks to Dirk. He had saved Kazma's life and gave away their loot to get her healed. Garrett owed more to Dirk than he could ever pay in a short amount of time. But perhaps due to his pride, he couldn't so much as say a word. His inner turmoil was great. Of course, Dirk didn't know nor care about Garrett's inner conflict. He took a deep breath after stepping outside feeling the nice night breeze on his face. It had been a bit stressful getting Kazma back outside the dungeon, but he had gotten her out safe and sound. He was rather proud of himself. As for the loot being spent all in one go, he didn't particularly mind. Regardless of how they performed, this was a learning experience. It wasn't as if their livelihoods depended on their success. Despite the downcast mood, Dirk actually found himself smiling a bit. In the face of danger, he had saved a life and gotten everyone to safety. Dirk had done this very few times in his past life. He was always alone, and even when people were dying in front of him, his focus was turned elsewhere, always prioritizing the mission. There were seldom opportunities to get someone to safety after they were mortally wounded. But now, he had actually prioritized someone's life over their mission. He had taken charge in a group, tactfully leading them out of a danger zone. Despite Dirk's dislike for Garrett and Kazma, he had still done a good thing of his own volition. It was a nice feeling. HMHM. Dirk hummed as he moved his shoulder, bumping it against Ava's. She turned to him confused before seeing his smiling face. Seeing his happiness, Ava's previously blue mood was brightened. She nudged back with her own shoulder, a bright smile plastered across her face. He, you did a good job. I'm proud of you. Ava was joyful as she wrapped her arm around Dirk's. She realized that he was happy to have saved a life. While things had gone wrong, it was Dirk who made sure that the situation never devolved beyond redemption. Kasma and even Garrett could have both died if Dirk hadn't been there. While he was usually very nonchalant about such things, 
seeing him happy like this was not only rare, but exciting. There were very few times where he found himself happy over an accomplishment. Not only that, but he even wanted her approval. Ava was more than willing to give that to him. Dirk smiled a bit more hearing Ava's praise, deciding to accept her compliment. He also enjoyed their little intimacy. After they made up and had a run-in with some robbers, they seemed to be getting even closer. Seeing their bright mood, Alex's mood also loosened up a bit. No matter what, they were all safe now, and Kazma wasn't in danger. This was something to celebrate over if anything. Garrett, on the other hand, wasn't happy seeing those two lovebirds getting cozy. He just stuck to the side though. If he ruined either of their moods by saying something, he might just get beaten up. He still remembered just how scary Dirk could be. No matter how angry Garrett was, he wasn't willing to face that monster. So, what should we do now? Eventually, Alec asked them as they stuck around the hospital building. He really didn't know where to go from here. Hearing this question, Dirk thought for a second. Well, we still have a job to complete. If we move quickly, we could make the 20-day deadline. It's been almost two weeks, so we have at most a week to finish. I don't think we can finish in that time. Alec shook his head as he thought about it. They had only collected the loot they did after two weeks of constant hunting. Now with Kazma's situation, there was no way they could just move forward like nothing happened. At this time, Garrett spoke up with a dull voice. I need to get Kazma back to the academy. She'll need more healing after this, and her parents will want to see her. Hmm. Hearing him, Alec frowned. If Garrett were to leave, then they would be down a porter. Nobody would be there to carry their bags, and it would hinder their fighting ability. However, when Dirk heard Garrett, he suddenly had an idea. Hey Alec, how about you take Garrett and Kazma back? Huh? Upon hearing Dirk's suggestion, Alec was surprised. Dirk continued. You guys take the luggage back. Ava and I will keep a few necessities and continue ourselves. We should be able to complete the job within the week, and then we'll head back. Alec was silent as he pondered. He wasn't stupid. He realized that Dirk wanted to work alone, or at least without the weak links. Ava was the only one who could keep up with him, and they were also close. If it were just them, they could move fast and efficiently. Even Garrett understood that they were only holding back Dirk. Alec wanted to complete the mission, seeing it through. At the same time though, everything that happened over the past several days had taken its toll on him. He wanted to go back to the academy and catch up on some classes while he recuperated. He had learned a lot on this trip. If he had to do things again, there would be many fewer mistakes. From watching Dirk, he also understood what he was lacking as a leader. He lacked the same decisiveness and ruthless decision-making. Alec got scared every time he thought about how Kazma would have died if it were just him. It was only his first dive, and a fellow classmate would have lost their life under his watch. He couldn't imagine having to not only report this, but confront their parents. It was a dreadful situation that he never wanted to face. At the same time, Alec understood how valuable competent partners were. Someone who could handle themselves and contribute to the group was apparently rare. He was understanding that bringing on weak people was asking for trouble. Alec knew that he was someone at the highest levels of his class. He had to start finding similar people and working with them. Dirk and Ava were the perfect people, but for now, he had a bit of catching up to do. Thinking of all this, Alec nodded at Dirk. That night, after Kazma was stitched up and released, the group made plans to return. Only Dirk and Ava would remain, and they packed two small bags worth of items. The rest went back with the group, Alec promising that their items would go back to their residences. Chapter 60 Partner The morning of the next day, Alec, Garrett, and Kazma boarded a wagon owned by a merchant. Their destination was the capital city where the academy was located. You two stay safe. I know I'm not there yet, but I hope I'll be able to take a job with you two again in the future. Alec shook Dirk and Ava's hands with a vow. Dirk and Ava were Alec's goal. He wanted to reach and stay at their level. He would need more experience, 
but that would come with time. Regardless, these two people were worth knowing. Alec definitely couldn't be a stranger to them. The three gave their goodbyes. After that, Dirk and Ava watched as their group members drove away. Now, it was just them. So, when do we get started? Ava asked as she glanced at Dirk. Just the two of them. It made her a bit excited. They had taken very few things from the luggage. For both of them, there was a single tent and blanket, two water bags, the loot bag, some changes of clothes, and a few other small necessities. These things fit in two small bags that they slung across their backs. The bags wouldn't get in the way much while fighting, so it was very ideal. With their ability to cook food and create water, the two of them could survive inside a dungeon indefinitely. They didn't even need pots or pans. Dirk could just form structures of hard stone with his earth magic. If they wanted an oven or pan, he could make it, though it would just be rock. How about now? We have a week to kill 140 skinks and collect their grade 3 fire mana crystals. That's 20 a day. Think we can do it? Dirk glanced at her, the two seeing the fighting spirit in each other's eyes. Ava smiled. I think we can. Then let's go. Saying that, Dirk turned and walked with Ava back to the dungeon. They entered with an unyielding confidence as if there was nothing that could stop them from achieving their goal. Behind. Yup. Splat. Within the dungeon, two people were currently facing off against three skinks. The sun was high in the sky, beaming down with energy-sapping heat. The skinks these two people fought also spat their own flames, attempting to sear their prey alive. Unfortunately, these skinks were not the first these people had killed, and they would be far from the last. The duo passed between the three skinks as they flourished their weapons with coordinated but ruthless swings, mauling the skinks until they couldn't stand. Finally, after only a few minutes, these skinks dropped to the floor, quenching the parched ground beneath them with blood. Dirk bent down to harvest the mana crystals of his kills. After carving through their leathery muscles and bones, he pulled out a warm red mana crystal. As he walked to the other couple of skinks, Ava took a seat on one of the corpses, letting out a breath. How many is that? Eighteen? Nineteen. Dirk corrected her as he plucked the last mana crystal. He then tossed it into the loot bag hanging from his waist. Standing up, he scanned the landscape around them. It had been three days since they entered the dungeon alone. The first two days, Dirk and Ava made their way straight toward the furthest haven. Because they were able to move so fast, they had some time to kill after reaching the haven the group had previously struggled to approach, taking time to hunt some of the strong skinks. After that, they went on to hunt the entire third day, bringing them to now. In this day alone, they had killed and harvested 19 skinks. Hearing that number, Ava nodded. We need at least 30 crystals a day to make the deadline. That first day, we could only hunt dune worms. That was a waste of time. Well, at least we have this area to ourselves. And nobody weighing us down. Dirk spoke as he looked at Ava. He and she had made a great team. They were fluid in their cooperation with each other. Dirk could hold down multiple skinks and she could chop them into pieces. They made quick work of every enemy they ran into, and they ran into a lot. Neither of them got hurt, and with nobody to worry about, they could focus entirely on the fight. While Ava thought Dirk's words about being held back were harsh to their former partners, she couldn't help but agree. When it was just them, they had no problems. Their efficiency was unbelievably higher than before. Plus, Ava couldn't deny that she liked being alone with Dirk. This was especially so at night. Because Dirk had wanted to pack light and didn't believe in unnecessary accommodations, he had only taken one tent. This meant that for the past two nights, Ava had slept right by Dirk's side. The two got plenty comfortable, huddling under one blanket and getting cozy in each other's warmth. The only problem that Ava found was that Dirk fell asleep far too fast. As soon as his head hit the pillow, he was out. While he could be awoken with the slightest touch or sound, Ava never bothered him. Still, just their being so close to each other made her giddy. 
All Ava's problems seemed distant as she hunted inside the dungeon with Dirk. They quickly moved from group to group, killing every skink they saw. With nobody to bother them, they were like ghosts as they drifted around the depths of the dungeon. When one got deep enough, there were truly more skinks than one knew what to do with. Sometimes, the duo would get into back-to-back -back fights, fighting for a dozen minutes at a time. One time, they had fought for an hour straight as skinks continued to pile on top of them. That battle had truly drawn a river of blood, alongside bountiful harvests of course. While individual fights weren't tiring, sequential ones were. The fatigue built up through the hours, and by the end of the day, Ava and Dirk were pushing themselves forward with sheer willpower. After all, they had to use anima and mana to fight these skinks, not just their bodily energy. Using techniques and magic consumed far more energy. But neither complained. If anything, they loved it. It was so much more exciting than training repetitively in the comfort of their home. They could let out their carnal instinct for bloodshed while honing their skill. During these times, Ava couldn't be happier. She was incredibly glad that she and Dirk got over their little spat. Ava appreciated everything she had ever done with Dirk. It was his training and effort that brought her to this point. She couldn't imagine the life she would have led if she had never said yes to him at school. The decision to begin training with him and his mother was the best choice she had ever made. Now, the fruits of her hard work were paying off more than she ever expected it would. All right, let's keep going. After resting for a bit, Dirk began walking off further into the depths of the dungeon. Ava's eyes gazed at his back before she stood and pranced over to him, bumping him with her shoulder. Like that, the two waited for more prey to find them, neither fearful with the support of the one next to them. Meanwhile, as Dirk and Ava fought in the dungeon, Alec was getting settled back into the academy. After arriving at the capital city, Garrett and Kazma went to the academy's hospital to get checked up. After finding that Kazma would be fine, they left and returned to their parents' residences. While Kazma wouldn't be permanently disabled, they needed to ensure that she wouldn't be mentally or physically incapable of progressing far in the future. After all, Kazma's success was the success of the family. Garrett's family interests were also aligned with her success since it was almost settled that they would be getting married in the future. So when Kazma returned to her parents, they were stunned silly. Their daughter's first dungeon dive ended so poorly. After hearing the story though, they didn't know what to say. Kazma had been lethally wounded, but it had been Dirk Strider that saved her life. While Garrett was resentful toward Dirk, Kazma had come to appreciate that heartless teenager. She didn't conceal that it had been his quick thinking that allowed her to be where she was now. If it weren't for his very presence, she would be nothing but food for a bunch of monsters. Such an attitude surprised Garrett. Kazma had been subject to what was essentially torture. She almost bled to death, then her flesh was seared shut. Then she was forced to move a few dozen miles while weak and sick, basically being dragged the whole way. Dirk was the ruthless monster that forced her through that, and Garrett was sure to highlight the pain he put Kazma through. But Kazma shut him down. Sure the experience was beyond dreadful. Kazma would take every measure to never go through something like that again. But after the pain subsided and she looked back, she realized just how lucky she was. Instead of making her feeble, the experience hardened her mind. If she could get through that, then she could get through anything else. She was a bit proud of herself for pushing through everything. Once she healed and got back on her feet, she would be stronger than ever. Kasma's parents also realized how lucky she was. After hearing the story and settling matters, Kasma's father personally paid a visit to the Strider household. It was here that he met Dirk's mother and left her a gift, a thank you for Dirk saving Kasma's life. The gift was two blue crystal shards. There were three levels of currency. Silver, gold, and crystal. These crystal shards were a unit of crystal currency. And each crystal was worth 1,000 gold coins. Kazma's father had actually paid 2,000 gold for saving Kazma's life. After Dirk's mother got an explanation for everything, she was surprised. After seeing Kazma's father off, she immediately went and found Alec, who told her the entire story. 
the story shocked Cecilia. It wasn't hard to see what happened, but she didn't know where Dirk could have learned the medical knowledge required to make the judgments he did. After she let Alec go, Cecilia pondered for a while with a frown. After eventually shaking her head, Cecilia disappeared with the decision to just wait until Dirk returned. Splat! Huff, that's thirty. Ava let out a labored breath after burying her axe in the head of a skink. Dirk also swiftly killed off his prey with a knife to its eye socket. There were thirteen bodies around them, and the sun was getting low. For more days had passed. This was now the seventh day that the two had entered the dungeon alone. They never once left. Their food consisted of cooked skink meat which they ate in the morning and night. At first, it had been a bit tough to eat. But over time, the two learned to enjoy it. The only thing Dirk made a mental note of was to bring seasoning on his next trip. Dirk had a faint smile on his face as he plucked out all the mana crystals. In his vision, he could see a counter with the number 142 on it. This was the number of mana crystals they had collected, and the number was tracked by Dirk's AI. They had finally hunted enough. Now, their job was complete. We're done. Dirk spoke, a little excitement in his voice. Hearing him, Ava was also excited. Finally. I didn't think we'd actually do it, by ourselves no less. It's been what, three weeks since we've left home? I've never been gone for so long in my entire life. Hmm. Dirk nodded in agreement. He had spent this entire life within the confines of the capital city, a place of peace, safety, and prosperity. Now, not only had he left, but he had done so for three weeks straight. He had no guide or parent with him. Their livelihoods depended on them alone in this place. While he was perfectly fine with this, for Ava this was a huge adventure. Everything was new and she had to mature a little in order to keep her bearings. Luckily, with Dirk here things became much easier. He was never phased by anything. Well, it looks like we can finally leave. We can start making our way back now. Let's sleep early and leave early in the morning. We can be on a wagon home in two days. Dirk spoke as he hoisted his back. However, Ava seemed to think of something else. Hey, what if we went to the King's Hall? King's Hall? Hearing her, Dirk was surprised. The King's Hall was basically the boss room for each dungeon. In the lesser dungeons like the one they were in, the most powerful of a species would form a King's Hall. One could fight the king, and if it was killed, then the victors would be awarded precious loot. However, there were two things that caused Dirk to frown. One, the king was an enemy that surpassed all others in a dungeon. Two, once someone entered the king's hall, they couldn't leave until either they or the king died. It was a life or death battle, and worse yet, they couldn't evaluate the power of the king until they entered personally. While it wouldn't outstrip the power level of the dungeon by far, it was still a significant jump. So far, Dirk and Ava had fought skinks that were at the higher end of the rank 3 level. These rank 3 skinks were large, strong, and fast. As for the king, it would most likely be a rank 4 skink. Not only that, but it would likely be able to use tier 3 magic. Dirk was rank 3 himself, and at the peak of rank 3 no less. He could slaughter the skinks they had been fighting all day, even by himself. However, he had never fought a rank 4 enemy before, and over time, Dirk had felt the difference between power levels in this world. The robbers he had killed had rank 2 strength. Despite that, Dirk had slaughtered them like they were nothing. They simply couldn't resist his strength. He could break their bones with his hands. Even back on Earth, no ordinary person could do such a thing. He had already surpassed his self from Earth, in terms of personal strength at least. Dirk was wary about fighting those above him, but at the same time, he wanted a challenge. He thought about it for a long while, weighing his odds. Slowly, he nodded. If you're confident, then we'll do it. But this is an all-in battle. You can't be indecisive. Dirk looked at Ava with a solemn face. Once they went in, there would be no coming out unless they succeeded. Just this fact alone worried Dirk. Ava naturally knew what fighting the king meant though. 
Hearing that he wasn't opposed, Ava was excited. Yes. Dirk, we can do it. Besides, we gotta push ourselves if we wanna get better. These kinds of battles will make us stronger. I guess. We rest first though. Let's head back. Of course. Ava was all smiles as she started walking back to the haven with Dirk. It only took an hour or so to arrive, and as they walked into the haven, they dragged the corpse of a skink with them. Right now, Dirk and Ava were the only ones in this haven. The other group that had been there was now long gone. The duo had the entire fortress to themselves. There weren't even any guards stationed here. Those would only be seen in the havens near the entrance of the dungeon. Dirk and Ava tossed their bags in the center of the open plot of land. Ava quickly got to setting up the tent while Dirk tossed the skink corpse to the side. He then bent down next to a certain rock formation nearby. This rock formation was the oven he had formed the day before. He hadn't gotten rid of it since there were no people here and he knew he would use it again. Dirk lit a fire above his hand. Facing his palm to the oven opening, he used a certain spell and shot his flames into the oven. These flames burned much hotter than ordinary flames, easily reaching thousands of degrees. It wasn't long before the interior of the oven was scorching hot, and with the stone absorbing so much heat, the temperature would linger for a long while. This made it easy to cook without constant flame. After that, Dirk went and cut up the skink corpse. He cut out the thickest cut of meat from the skink around its abdomen and legs. Then, he cut them into strips before tossing them into the oven. The meat sizzled as the heat from the stone rapidly cooked it. Dirk was sure to occasionally heat up the oven with his flames too, keeping the temperature constant. After setting up the tent and making it as homely as it could get, Ava also went over and sat next to Dirk. It wasn't long before he pulled out these strips of meat and put them onto a clean stone plate. They were thoroughly cooked but still tender and juicy. While the taste was bland with no seasoning, they could only make do. The two dug in as Dirk tossed in plenty of meat for the both of them. After about an hour, the two were totally full. H.M., that was pretty good. You've gotten better. Thanks. Hmm. I'll take care of the corpse. Ava smiled at him before suddenly standing up. She walked over to the skink corpse which had been half-gutted before grabbing its tail and dragging it out of the haven. Once she exited, she activated the anima in her body and began swinging around her. After building enough momentum, she let go and flung the skink away. The corpse went flying through the air before landing about 90 meters away with a solid thud. Yes. Ava cheered for herself before walking back in. All monster corpses would disappear naturally with time, so they didn't need to worry about burning trash or anything themselves. They could just toss it out in the open and the dungeon would decompose it itself. All right, be sure to get plenty of sleep tonight. Dirk spoke as Ava trotted back to his side. Wake up whenever you want. We'll only go to the King's Hall when we're totally ready. We're also going to leave most of our auxiliary items here. We'll only bring in our gear to fight with. There can't be any distractions. Other than that, fighting skinks to reach the King's Hall will serve as our warm-up. Don't be nervous, but don't be relaxed. We just need to keep sharp and hope we'll be fine. Dirk laid out his plans. He truly hated how one couldn't enter and exit the King's Hall as they pleased. If they were to enter and immediately find that the skink was beyond their level, then they could only fight to their death. It could be seen as a path of no return. This was something Dirk absolutely despised. But he also wasn't a coward. He had gone through plenty of crisis battles where all seemed hopeless on earth, and he had used his wits in daring to carve a path out. Because of this confidence, he was willing to take the risk. If he wanted to become something great in this world, he had to be willing to do such things. Gone were the old rules. Dirk was finally taking a plunge into the deep end of this world. Not only that, but he had someone to fight with, a partner to face adversity alongside. Chapter 61, King's Hall The next morning, Ava slept for ten hours. Dirk also slept longer than normal. He woke up earlier than Ava, but decided to stay until she woke up herself. 
there were two reasons for this. The first was that he didn't mind the relaxation. Just laying there in silence alone with his thoughts wasn't always so bad. The second reason though was that Ava had rolled over at some point in the night, basically putting herself on top of him. She used him as a body pillow and a source of body heat. Since Dirk didn't wish to disturb her, he let it be. He definitely wasn't remaining there because he enjoyed it. Definitely not. Hmm. Eventually, Ava finally woke up. Upon opening her eyes, she immediately saw Dirk's face. She quickly realized what she was doing. But she didn't move. She just closed her eyes again and shifted her body, getting cozier. Dirk gawked a tiny bit as wasn't sure what to say. So for a little while, he just remained silent. But at some point, he noticed that he couldn't feel his arm. He let out a breath before breaking the silence. Ava. Hmm. Ava looked at him, her chin on his chest. I can't feel my arm. H.M.? Oh. S. Sorry. Ava let out a sheepish smile before lifting her body. Dirk also sat up, and his arm dangled by his side. He sat there for a minute as blood flowed back into his limb, making it tingle before finally gaining control. That's better. Dirk chuckled a bit as he clenched his fist. He then turned to Ava who was watching him with shiny eyes. They looked at each other for a while. Are you ready for today? Eventually, Dirk asked. Ava nodded. Yeah. I'm well rested. I hope so. You used my arm as a pillow. He, he it was very comfortable. Ava chuckled mischievously. Dirk rolled his eyes with a smile before finally crawling out of the tent. The two spent the next few hours getting ready. Dirk went out and caught a skink to eat while Ava broke down their tent. After cooking and eating, the two took their time gearing up. Dirk did a check on every one of his weapons. After thinking for a while, he set aside his bow and arrows. His bow had become mostly useless after they started facing the stronger skinks. It usually wouldn't pierce their hide and if it did, it would do minor damage. Since the king they were going to fight was even stronger, the bow would just be an extra item to carry. So Dirk set it with the rest of the items that he didn't plan on bringing. This included the tents and the loot bag. Everything except for their gear would be left behind. After searching around the haven, Dirk eventually found a nice hiding spot. He set all the extra items here. As for the loot bag, he decided to bury that just outside of the haven. When that was done, Dirk and Ava were set. It was now a bit past noon. The sun was already high in the sky and cooking the ground below it. Dirk and Ava met roiling heat waves when they stepped outside, but neither minded it as they began walking. The haven they were at was only several miles away from the King's Hall which was stationed at the edge of the dungeon. Because of that, it only took the duo a few hours to arrive. Along the way, they fought off around a dozen skinks, using them to refresh themselves and get their bodies adjusted. Dirk could tell that Ava was nervous as she fought, but over time her jitters lightened up. With that, the two gradually came upon another structure. It was a cave with a black maw for an entrance. It looked like the entrance to the dungeon, with the same barrier of murky black film. Dirk carefully walked up to it. This is it. Let's go. Dirk had already hardened his mind and committed to this, so he didn't hesitate to walk in. Ava grabbed his hand as the two pushed through the black film. After a feeling of suspension, they two stumbled forward. What met their eyes was a large cave. The cave was about 100 meters long and 50 meters wide, stretching in front of the duo like the road to doom. At the end of the 100 meters were two large doors. These doors were pitch black, not unlike the black barrier they walked through the get in here. The only difference were the slight designs on the black doors depicting grand dragons and the thrones of kings. Other than the doors, Dirk could immediately see three enemies. These enemies were skinks, only, they were quite a bit larger than the ones outside. On all fours they stood almost five feet tall, and their claws were longer, sharper, and stronger. Upon entering, these three skinks flipped around to the two invaders, looking at them with overbearing eyes. 
Dirk didn't immediately rush to fight though. Instead, he looked behind him. He could see the black barrier that they passed through. Thinking, Dirk took Ava's hand and walked back through the barrier. She didn't question him and followed. Sure enough, Dirk quickly felt the crunch of dead dirt beneath his feet. He smiled as the sun beamed down upon his body. So it's only an interlude. That's good. He nodded. It looked like upon entering the king's hall, one wasn't immediately thrown into the main battle. There was a small appetizer beforehand, one that they could freely enter and exit. Once one stepped through those black doors though, that was it. Dirk knew that's where the life or death battle lay. With that, he walked back in. They went face to face with those three skinks once more. This time, Dirk moved to fight, as did Ava. The two rushed forward, and the skinks opened their mouths. Screech! The three let out sharp screams that reverberated through the cave. They scurried over toward Dirk and Ava with surprisingly fast movements. Dirk was surprised as one of the skinks charged him, its throat glowing orange and mouth opening up. A second one was doing the same thing, both aiming at Dirk who was in the front. Seeing this, he didn't raise anything to block. Instead, he heard a soft shout. I got it. Ava spoke as she stood in front of him. The next moment, a thick water wall was created in front of them. Of course, this water wall was much stronger than normal. These skinks were larger and likely had stronger magic attacks. Ava knew how to compensate despite not having seen their power. Without suspense, the two skinks let their flames out. Scorching red fire bellowed at Ava's water wall like an erupting volcano. Ava frowned as her water wall was rapidly consumed, filling the air with a fog. Wall! Ava shouted as flames tore at her water barrier. The next second, a thick stone wall was created in front of her. The flames rapidly broke past her water wall and then hit the stone wall. They couldn't break through it though, merely heating the surface. With that, the flames ended. Dirk put his hand on Ava's shoulder. I got the one that didn't spit fire. You pick the one on the far right. We go together in three. With those instructions, he counted. When he hit zero, he and Ava rushed out from behind the wall. Ava quickly spotted a skink on the right, while Dirk eyed the skink that didn't spit fire which was in the center. As for the extra one on the left, he had plans for it too. Ava was quick to engage in battle, her axe chopping down at her target. However, the skink was agile, and it could dodge her attacks. Ava had a hard time landing hits. Her axe was powerful, but it was worth nothing if she couldn't land a hit. Instead, the skink actually attacked her, swiping with its long claws. Ava was startled as the claws scraped her armor, leaving discolored streaks along the metal. She continuously dodged for a while. This caused her to realize that she couldn't take these enemies lightly. She activated the anima in her body, drawing out more strength. While she couldn't deliberately activate anima like Dirk's ability, she could expend more energy and utilize her muscles to a greater degree achieving the same effect but with lesser results. After doing this, Ava's senses became sharper, her body lighter. Her reactions were exceptional as she dodged a claw swipe and countered with a swing of her axe. This time, her axe flew much faster, arriving in front of the skink before it could dodge. Splat! Chunks of flesh flew as her axe tore through the skink, almost severing a limb. The skink screamed as it backed away, much more vigilant but Ava remained right on top of it. She flipped the table and went on the offensive, her axe moving at unnatural speeds. It didn't take long for several gashes to open up on the skink's body. This caused Ava to frown even more though. Normally, a skink would have been obliterated after only a few of her chops. But this one took several, and it had barely been mortally wounded. Their bodily strength and toughness were at a whole other level and Ava's consumption of energy wasn't light. Maintaining this speed and strength put high stress on her body while sapping at her energy. It only took a few minutes for fatigue to build. By that time though, her battle was decided. She gradually relaxed her body as the skink got weaker and weaker. 
Finally, with one last chop the skink was killed. Ava let out a breath before turning her head. What she saw surprised her. Dirk was single-handedly fighting off the other two skinks. He would chop at one with his hand axe before wielding his spear like a javelin, throwing it at the other before rushing over and stabbing with his knife. It was a beautiful series of movements that transferred the blades of his weapons from one body to another, continuously wounding both. His agility was unmatched, able to dodge all the claw swipes and return his own blows. He would even punch and kick, not hesitant to use everything at his disposal when the situation called for it. Compared to him, Ava's fight was crude and brutish. It wasn't long after Ava killed her skink that Dirk killed his too. With a spear to the eye and an axe to the head, both dropped dead to the floor, blood seeping from a dozen wounds all over their body. Amazingly enough, all of their wounds were either around vital areas or joints. None of Dirk's attacks had been anywhere wasteful like the abdomen or back. However, although his fight looked easy, it took plenty of energy. Dirk took long and deep breaths as he calmed himself. To match the speed and strength of these skinks wasn't easy. It was only his enhanced body, stamina, and skillful use of anima that allowed him to conserve energy. So? How is it? Dirk turned to Ava after a few seconds. He was asking about the fight. If it was too difficult, then fighting the king wouldn't be a good idea. Ava just put up a thumb though. It was good. It took more effort than usual, but that's not a bad thing. With my brawn and your skill, we can handle harder. Let's hope you're right. Dirk sighed as he approached the doors. These were the doors to the actual king's hall. Once inside, they would have to kill the king, or be killed instead. If they died, they would evaporate into nothingness, not even their parents knowing what happened. Such a thing would be incredibly tragic, a fate Dirk would never resign himself to. But he knew that the previous battle was a good taste for what was to come. Those skinks were only weaker than the king. The king wouldn't be much stronger than them. If those skinks were at the lowest end of rank 4, then the king was probably right at the middle of rank 4, maybe just below it. Dirk himself was at the peak of rank 3. It wouldn't be long until he completed his blood destruction. Already he was experiencing large boosts to his stamina and recovery ability. This was the perk from completing blood destruction. After fighting and waiting a few minutes, he was already capable of fighting again. This recovery ability was what let him fight those lesser skinks on the outside so easily, lasting through an entire day of battle. Once the process was done, he would experience yet another jump in his endurance. Dirk and Ava waited outside the doors, taking their time to recover. During this time, Dirk went and harvested the mana crystals from those three skinks. They were larger and packed to the brim with fiery mana, obviously a higher grade than the ones they had been collecting. After that, he rested at Ava's side. It was only when an hour passed that they finally stood up, fully rejuvenated. Dirk would take no chances and decided to give things time even after he was fully recovered. With the previous warm-up and full recovery, it could be said that they were in tip-top shape. Along with certain pieces of insurance Dirk had, he walked toward the doors with confidence. There was no turning back, and he would throw everything he had at this battle. Dirk and Ava held hands as they arrived in front of the doors. With their free hands, they pushed forward. The black doors creaked open with a loud rumbling that seemed to disturb the hall after a long time. Upon opening the door, the two immediately felt a strong aura wash over them. Dirk could feel the strength of his enemy through this aura. It was overbearing and savage, seemingly undefeatable. But Dirk knew that it wasn't. He could feel that behind the savagery, there was a limit. Dirk could see this limit, and he instantly made a judgment. It would be a tough battle, but not an impossible one. And that was all he needed. Dirk walked into the king's hall, his aura pushing away the savage pressure of the king with the ruthless steps of a cold killer. Nothing could face him as he met his enemy. The doors closed behind them, signifying the start of this battle. As they did so, back in the cave, there was an invisible pair of eyes that watched the two enter the king's hall. When the doors finally shut, these eyes curved as if they were smiling before disappearing into the darkness. 
Chapter 62, Battle You are entering the king's hall. Behold, Horned Lizard King of Fire. Upon entering the king's hall, Dirk and Ava received a message that appeared in their vision. This was the record, the same one that gave them the profile, tiers, ranks, and skills. This prompt surprised both of them. The record never spoke to them of its own volition. This was the first time they had seen such a thing. Despite the surprise, they could quickly surmise what this was. The large black doors shut behind them, and suddenly, the surroundings lit up. The duo covered their eyes as the sun beamed down on top of them. Right now, they were in an incredibly deep hole. The hole had walls on all sides in the shape of a circle that slightly curved inward like a dome, making the place look like an arena. The walls were composed of sandstone and the floor of dry dirt. A dry heat that felt like an oven permeated the atmosphere. Luckily, both of the challengers had resistances to heat. They quickly adapted to the situation. After looking around, Dirk and Ava set their sights on the ground floor of the arena. They couldn't immediately spot the king, something that caused Dirk to frown. His eyes rapidly scanned the surroundings, even turning to the walls. Enemy detected. Suddenly, Dirk's AI highlighted something in his vision. Dirk's eyes snapped to a large rock about 130 meters in front of him. His eyes narrowed as the AI did scans of the light coming from this rock. When a part of the rock twitched, Dirk's eyes widened. Growl. Right when Dirk spotted the king, there was a low rumble. Dirk patted Ava and then pointed to the large rock. She looked over and saw two golden spots appear on the rock. These spots had slits in them that sent a chill down her body. They were eyes. Then, the rock slowly moved. It unraveled and revealed its body that was twelve feet long and five feet tall. Its mouth stood on even grounds with Dirk's head. Its eyes looked down on him, fitting of the king of this dungeon. The king. Ava mumbled as she shrunk back at the size of the king. The king was a horned lizard. Its body was comprised of dark, rock-hard scales. Short spikes jutted out all along the sides of its head and back, their tips sharp like spears. Between these scales, there was a faint orange glow. Heat waves came from these crevices around its body, clearly signifying fire. The horned lizard didn't scream or roar at them. It just observed them, like a predator staring at a tasty treat. It didn't believe that these two invaders posed any threat. Your axe will be important. After a bit of silence, Dirk spoke. Ava looked at him before looking back at the lizard. Its body was definitely tough, but under her axe, nothing had yet to be able to resist. Her attacks were powerful and heavy, chopping through any amount of defense. For this tank of a lizard, it would be the most effective weapon. We'll split up. You take left, I take right. Stay back at first while I draw its attention. Once it focuses on me, find an opportunity to strike. Aim for limbs or vital areas. And watch out for the tail. Got it. Ava nodded as Dirk gave her orders. This wasn't the first time he had planned out an attack, and she could already visualize what she would do. However, she also knew that there would be a lot of adaptation. Dirk was never one for specific courses of action. Plans could be broken and changed. Sometimes they would have to improvise. Ava knew to do so if she had to, and she never had to worry about Dirk. She had a blind trust in his ability, one that surpassed her fear of any strong enemy. As Dirk spoke, the lizard rose and took steps toward them. Its throat and scales began to glow a vibrant orange that contrasted against its dark body. Seeing this, Dirk's pupils contracted. Go! With a shout, the duo split up. Ava ran off to the side, and Dirk darted straight forward. In order to attract the attention of the lizard, he obviously needed to aggravate it. This could be done easiest head on. Growl! The lizard's body rumbled as Dirk ran straight toward it. Its throat expanded as roiling flames brewed within. As this happened, Dirk rapidly covered ground. His hand also glowed with a magic spell. At the same time, animal was activated within his body, filling it with a violent strength. Then, the lizard's mouth opened. 
Dirk saw light shine through its razor-sharp teeth, and he let out a breath. Whoosh! As if its body were a flamethrower, flames billowed out of the lizard's body. Dirk was still a few dozen meters away, yet the flames arrived in mere seconds. Suddenly, his body dipped down, and he was engulfed by flame. Ava watched this from the side, not yet charging forth. Seeing Dirk get covered in flames, her teeth clenched. She waited, but the lizard continued to fire out flames for several seconds. The flames were surprisingly narrow and almost covered the length of the entire arena. The power behind these flames could be imagined. Eventually though, the lizard stopped. Ava watched as a cloud of smoke cleared away. What was revealed underneath was a stone slab that jutted out of the ground. The side of the slab facing the flames was basically melted, and on the other side, a figure was crouched beneath. That's warm. Ava heard a mumble. Then, she could see Dirk fly out from beneath the slab. She could see burn marks on his armor, but that was it. Dirk's armor covered every part of his body. His head was covered by a hood and even his face had a mask across it. To burn his skin would require one to burn through his armor first. Ava sighed when she saw that he was okay. She then saw Dirk fearlessly continue his charge. With spear in hand, pillars of rock shot out from beneath his feet. In a mere few steps, he was in front of the lizard. The lizard swung its claw at his approaching figure, and he thrust out. Shick! Screech! The lizard let out a small scream as Dirk's spear pierced into the webbing of its claw. However, Dirk's body became tense. The tip of his spear was about a foot long. It was a double-edged blade and with Dirk's strength behind it, he could price into most heights. However, even with his strength, the spear tip only pierced two inches into the lizard's claws. A light amount of blood seeped onto the spear tip as Dirk quickly pulled back. When Dirk moved back a few feet, the lizard pushed forward with a newfound rage. It swiped its long arms at Dirk, threatening to shred his armor to pieces. He dodged and swung his own spear while continuously activating the anima in his body. When the spear blade hit the lizard's flesh, it left shallow cuts. When it hit its claws, the two let out grating sounds as if two swords were clashing. Dirk's spear arts weren't fancy or skillful. They could be called crude. But in his hands, it was still a deadly weapon. It didn't take a genius to see how it should be used, and Dirk could rapidly become proficient with any weapon. He had already practiced with his spear for many hours while in the dungeon, so now, his spear use was beginning to resemble a somewhat trained warrior. Dirk went back and forth with the lizard for a minute or so, his spear constantly blocking or attacking. After receiving over a dozen small slices, the lizard began to become more defensive. One small cut wasn't a lot, but if they started to stack up, it would become too painful and fighting would become difficult. The lizard wasn't intelligent, but it still had its fighting instincts. Dirk also found out that while this lizard was big and strong, it wasn't fast. With Dirk's agility, there wasn't much he couldn't dodge. This would also be advantageous to another certain someone. After Dirk had fought for a while, there were suddenly footsteps that came from nearby. Both Dirk and the lizard heard this. The lizard wanted to turn around, but that's when Dirk pressed his attacks. He became more aggressive as he thrust his spear toward the lizard's neck. To this, the lizard could only refocus and swipe out to block. Meanwhile, Ava was getting close. Upon seeing an opening, she charged forth with her axe in hand. She came up right behind the lizard intending to chop off one of its legs. When she got close though, the lizard screamed. The lizard suddenly charged at Dirk. Dirk's eyes widened as that huge body came barreling toward him. He quickly backed up. That lizard definitely weighed hundreds if not over a thousand pounds. He absolutely could not let it pin him down and attack as it pleased. But this gave it an opening. After Dirk backpedaled, the lizard swiped to create distance before turning its head back. Its eye on the side of its head saw Ava who was taking her last steps toward it. It couldn't turn around to attack. But it didn't have to. Suddenly, Ava saw its tail come swinging around. The tail was like a hammer as it slammed into the side of her body. She was thrown away, 
tumbling across the ground. After that, the lizard focused back on Dirk. After blocking one of his attacks, the lizard continued its charge. Dirk grunted as he turned and ran, the lizard hot on his tail. Dirk? Ava quickly recovered. When she did, she looked to see Dirk running across the arena. She wasn't in the mood to laugh at this rare sight though and dashed toward her axe that had flown out of her grip. After she picked it up, she joined in the chase right behind the lizard. Like this, the battle became a game of cat and mouse. Dirk thought of several things as he ran. He didn't run so fast so the lizard stayed focused on him, a careful balance being maintained. Ava also didn't get too close so as to watch out for the tail. She then remembered Dirk's warning and felt a bit stupid. This chase didn't continue for long though. Thinking of something, Dirk raised his hand. Pouring mana into a spell, for rock arrows were created overhead. These rock arrows shot toward the lizard's head. However, when the arrows hit, the arrow tips merely cracked on the lizard's rock-solid hide, not doing any damage. The lizard barely noticed as it continued chasing Dirk. Never mind then. Seeing how useless his magic was on this lizard, Dirk just shook his head before thinking of other alternatives. Then, after getting an idea, Dirk changed directions toward one of the walls. He charged right at it, and the lizard's mouth slightly opened in anticipation for the meal that was apparently trying to kill itself. Ava, chop its tail when you can. Dirk shouted as he got closer to the wall. Ava didn't say anything as she focused on the tail. Then, Dirk arrived at the wall. A magic circle instantly appeared on his hand, and he jumped. Dirk's foot hit the wall, and a small foothold appeared under it. Like that, he took three steps up the wall. Then, his body bent back as he pushed off. The lizard raised its head as he sailed over it, flipping and landing on its back. Dirk brought down his spear. Asterisk screech. Asterisk. The lizard let out a ferocious scream as the spear was buried in its back with Dirk's full momentum behind it. At the same time, Ava came from behind and brought down her axe. Her heavy blade chopped right into the base of the lizard's tail. However, even that only chopped halfway through. The lizard screamed once more as it whipped its body around, swiping at Ava. Shing! Ava couldn't react before the lizard's claws came slicing across. Those sharp, almost metallic bones grated against her armor as she was tossed away once more. Seeing this, Dirk felt a surge of anger come over him. Looking down, he took out his own hand axe and chopped. Screech! The lizard yelled once more as Dirk quickly chopped at it. His blade didn't sink very far down, definitely not hitting any vitals. But it tore up the muscles and even fractured its large bones. The lizard started to toss its body around in an attempt to throw him off, but Dirk used the spear as an anchor. He chopped a few more times. However, he then saw the lizard charge toward one of the walls. His eyes remained cold as he braced himself. Then, when the lizard threw its back against the wall, he jumped off. Bang! The lizard caused the arena to shake as its huge body slammed into the wall. While this caused Dirk's spear to bend and tear up some more flesh, it was worth it since Dirk was now off its back. The lizard turned to him with rage in its eyes, and its throat started to glow. Arg! At that time, Dirk heard a pain groan. He turned and saw Ava who was kneeling on the floor. Beside her was a small puddle of blood. She had been injured, and it looked like she had sustained more than just a few cuts. While she might not have broken a bone, she likely had really bad trauma from the impact. Dirk's head alternated between the lizard and Ava once. Then, he charged toward Ava. At the same time, the lizard opened its mouth, flames just about ready to billow out. To me! Dirk shouted. Ava heard him and looked up. She saw the lizard and Dirk who was running toward her. Gritting her teeth, she got up and ran forward to him. Then, the lizard finally attacked. A pillar of flame shot out of its mouth. It rapidly chased Dirk and threatened to burn him to a crisp. Even with his armor, he would be cooked alive. Not even his own fire resistance could defend against the lizard's high-tier flames. 
just as the fire was going to reach him, Dirk met with Ava. Their bodies collided as he took them to the floor. Then, his hand raised. A slab of thick stone was erected behind them. The flames crashed into the stone and were divided around it. Dirk and Ava were then surrounded by a sea of fire. Ava curled up as Dirk covered her body with his. Tongues of flame flickered and whipped past them, burning some of Dirk's armor and singeing some of Ava's hair. They stayed like this as Dirk poured mana into the slab of stone protecting them. Even then, the surface was quickly melted. Perhaps because of its rage, the lizard shot out flame for several seconds longer. By the time it was done, the slab of stone had almost melted through. Can you fight? At that time, Dirk raised his head and asked. Ava looked at him, their faces only inches apart. Yes. Ava resolutely spoke. The wounds she sustained were mostly superficial. While it hurt to move, she could push through that pain. The adrenaline coursing through her body helped her as well. All right. Split up. Recover your axe when you can. I'm going to attack it. You find an opening. Okay. Then let's go. Saying that, the two rolled out from under the slab. Dirk jumped to his feet and laid eyes on the lizard. The lizard looked at him, flames in its eyes. Both were furious. Reaching toward his chest, Dirk pulled out a long knife. He then ran straight toward the lizard. The lizard moved forward and met the charge. Ava also slipped away and found her axe, going to retrieve it. Normally, Dirk wanted to maintain distance from the lizard. It was simply too risky to fight it in close combat. But Dirk didn't have his other weapons as they were stuck in the lizard's back. He needed to keep the lizard's attention while Ava snuck in from behind. So he took the risk. In his eyes, the AI plotted out the various reactions the lizard could have. It was always watching Dirk's battles, analyzing the enemies before it. With this, Dirk met the lizard. The lizard threw out one of its claws. Each claw was almost a foot long. Dirk wasn't nervous as he met these though. His eyes turned apathetic as his body bent. Whoosh! The claw sailed right past him, brushing past the leather of his armor and leaving small tears. Dirk's body straightened out as he took a step to the side. As this happened, four fireballs appeared above Dirk's head. While Dirk maneuvered around, these fireballs came down and exploded on the lizard's face. The lizard closed its eyes and ducked away as the fire brushed over it. Since it was the so-called king of fire though, the fire naturally didn't hurt it, just brushing over the scales like a warm summer breeze. Dirk wasn't trying to hurt it though. While the lizard was distracted, he stabbed his knife into the side of its body. The lizard yelled as he pulled himself back onto its back. Ha! Ah. Dirk yelled as he grabbed his axe, pulling it out of the lizard's back. Then, before the lizard could start thrashing around, he jumped off. The lizard saw this and turned to him, swiping out with its claws again. At this time though, Dirk could see Ava coming in from behind. She was about to attack, but if Dirk didn't keep the lizard's attention, it would likely pull back to escape them both. Thinking of this, Dirk didn't hesitate as he rushed right at the claw the lizard swung at him. He swung his own axe. Just before the claws tore across his body, his axe chopped into the lizard's arm. The arm fell limp as tendons and muscles tore. As if it couldn't feel pain though, the lizard opened its threatening maws and pulled Dirk in with its arm. Dirk pulled back his axe, but before he could jump backward, the lizard chomped down. Ack! The lizard's razor-sharp teeth bit down on Dirk's shoulder. Some teeth scraped against metal while others bit into the leather. The leather couldn't stop the teeth from totally penetrating through. Even the teeth that didn't tear through the leather punctured Dirk's skin with an oppressive bite force. Under that bit force, Dirk felt like his bones were going to give. With a thought, he gave an order to his AI. Overdrive. Activating overdrive. Suddenly, Dirk's muscles bulged with strength that resisted the lizard. His body heat up as blood soaked his shirt underneath his armor. Growl. Ah. 
Dirk and the lizard both let out their own low roars as it bit down harder and harder on Dirk's body. It flung him around after raising him off the floor, causing its teeth to tear into his skin even further. If it weren't for Dirk activating tons of anima and adding overdrive on top of that, some bones would have shattered. Dirk didn't just let himself be thrown around though. With his left hand, he quickly grabbed one of the knives on his thigh and stabbed out. He stabbed the lizard's mouth and throat several times in quick succession, causing it to scream and whip its head around. When it finally opened its mouth, Dirk was thrown away like a ragdoll. Thud! Arg! Dirk grunted as he hit the floor and tumbled, blood dyeing the ground where he landed. Despite the pain, his body quickly jumped to its feet, his eyes moving back to the lizard. The lizard looked back at Dirk, about to charge him again. At this time though, it felt a horrible burning in its leg. Screech! The lizard screamed as Ava came from behind and chopped its leg. After seeing Dirk get chewed alive, Ava was burning with both panic and a vengeful rage. She put all her power into a precise strike, hitting the joint of the lizard's leg. The axe slid right through its flesh, sliding between the bones and separating the leg in two. Along with the hand that Dirk had injured, the lizard now had two limbs that were disabled, and it barely supported itself unsteadily. That wasn't all though. Ava followed that strike with another, this time aiming for its head. She didn't mind the weak claw strike that came at her, chopping straight toward the lizard's neck. The claw collided with her body, but at the same time, her axe was buried into its flesh. Now, the lizard couldn't even scream. It gurgled as blood poured from its neck. It attempted to disregard the pain and chomp at Ava with its teeth, but not only did she not dodge, but she raised her leg and kicked the lizard's mouth. With her greatest strength behind that leg, the lizard's head was flung to the side. Then, Ava brought her axe back down onto its neck. Slice. This time, the axe slid straight through. The skink collapsed to the floor as its head was almost totally separated from its body. Blood rapidly pooled below it as Ava let out rapid breaths. Huff. Huff. Dirk. Taking a deep breath, Ava spun around and found Dirk who kneeled on the floor. She ran over to him despite her weakening body. I'm fine. Good job with the kill. No. If you weren't distracting it, I wouldn't have been able to hit it. How are your wounds? Nothing serious. Dirk spoke as he stood up. Ava checked his body despite his words, but at that moment, something happened. Congratulations. The Horned Lizard King of Fire has been eliminated. Your reward has been decreed. The King's Hall will reset in ten hours. Chapter 63, Reward Reward? After Dirk and Ava were prompted, they looked at each other. Not long after, there was a rumbling in the ground. The two looked over. In the center of the arena, a stone altar constructed of pearl-white marble and clad with the most perfect engravings on its sides rose from the ground. The engravings were symmetrically beautiful and had gold accents to the curves, making the entire thing an artistic masterpiece. Atop this altar were two golden bowls, each with an item inside. Dirk and Ava were surprised before walking over together. The two got a closer look at the items. In the left bowl was a necklace. This necklace held a blue gem that glowed and swirled with cold mana. This gem looked similar to a mana crystal and radiated the power of the water element. In the right bowl, the two saw a ring. This ring was made from a black metal and embedded with a gem that swirled with gray mana, obviously the dark element. It seems these rewards are tailored to us. Hmm. Ava spoke as she looked between the two rewards. It was obvious who the rewards were intended for. Only Ava could utilize anything with the water element, and only Dirk could use anything with the dark element. The two took their rewards, stroking them with their fingers. Dirk curiously looked at the ring. It wasn't an amazing piece of art, just a metal band that held the gem. He could faintly see runes on it though, signifying an enchantment. Without much thought, he placed the ring on his ring finger, but surprisingly it didn't fit. Taking it off, he slipped it over his index and then middle finger before finally putting it on his thumb where it fit snugly. 
After that, Dirk felt a bit of the dark element stream into his hand, as if calling out to him. Thinking, Dirk sent his own mana into the ring. At that moment, he felt some information pop into his mind. An empty space. Dirk could see a spherical area about four feet in diameter. This spherical area was like a small ball of space, and through inserting his mana into the ring, he could understand what this space was. Pocket space? Dirk was surprised. He had read about this before. Enchanting was an extremely difficult job, especially at high levels. Enchanting with the elements posed various challenges of their own, and they all gave different effects. Many enchantment abilities and effects were exclusive to certain elements. One of the most famous enchanted abilities was spatial storage. There were things called pocket spaces that could be created only by enchanting an item with the dark element. Not only did this require a dark enchanter, but also a dark mana crystal. Bring the two together, and you could create a pocket space, an independent space that could contain items. The item that Dirk had was called a pocket ring, and it was exactly this independent space. While the space wasn't large, Dirk could already see how useful it was. He could store the bags and loot he didn't want to carry inside of this ring. He could also contain food and water inside, though the food could still go bad, so it wasn't like Dirk could prepare luxury meals beforehand. Either way, this pocket ring was one of the famous items that was brought about by the enchanting profession, and its utility was obvious. Dirk pleasantly smiled. Is that really what I think it is? At that moment, Ava looked over at Dirk. He nodded to her. It's a pocket ring. The space is about four feet in diameter. Really? That's awesome. I can't believe you actually got one of those. Those rings are expensive. Ava looked at the ring on Dirk's thumb with glowing eyes. The low-level rings weren't exactly rare, but they really were expensive. It could cost hundreds of gold for a basic one, and the large ones could cost a dozen crystals. The one Dirk had was one of the most basic, and after working jobs for a while, they could probably save enough for one of their own pocket rings. Getting anything better though was a luxury for the powerful or wealthy. Dirk agreed with Ava's excitement. The next moment, Ava raised her necklace and beckoned Dirk. Hey! Put it on me? All right. Dirk smiled a bit as Ava handed him the necklace. After raising her hair and turning around, Dirk hooked it around her neck. She stroked it with a joyful expression. Thank you. Sure. We should get going now. We need to get out and get back to our bags so we can take care of our wounds. If we stay too long then our bodies will weaken. Of course. Ava nodded to him before weakly hoisting her axe. After that, Dirk went over to the lizard's body that gradually cooled over time. He grabbed his spear on its back and then his hatchet that was on the ground. Sheathing everything, Dirk was about to leave when he looked back at the lizard. Within its body he could sense a dense cluster of mana. It was a mana crystal. Looks like the body is our reward too. Dirk smiled pleasantly as he went over to the lizard's head. Slicing open its tough muscle, he sifted around before plucking out the mana crystal. This one was bigger than the usual marbles and radiated a soft heat that warmed Dirk's hands. He nodded before playing around with his pocket ring, eventually figuring out how to place the mana crystal in the pocket space. After slipping the mana crystal in and out of the ring a few times, he hummed before walking back over to Ava. With that, the two defeated the king of the dungeon and received their rewards. Normally Dirk would think that he could come back and continue defeating this king, receiving more rewards like this. But unfortunately, a reward could only be gained once. If Dirk wanted another reward, then he would have to go to another dungeon and defeat the king there. The only thing that could be constantly farmed was the body of the king, and there were in fact those who would constantly kill the king and harvest the body, gaining a steady supply of wealth. After settling everything, Dirk and Ava left back the way they came. They pushed through the large black doors and walked through the king's hall where the three skink bodies still lay. Then, they walked through the black portal before stepping foot back onto the desert. The two moved steadily, both fighting the pain of their wounds as they headed toward the haven. 
while Dirk's wounds were worse than Ava's, she didn't have the nanites he did. His nanites were quick to seal the wounds and stop bleeding. But Ava continued to bleed for a while as her wounds were aggravated. Not only did she have bad bruises, but deep slices across her body. Nothing that would stop her from fighting, but enough to cause her plenty of pain. Worse yet, the two encountered skinks on their way back. When these groups found them, Dirk did his best to fight them all, sparing Ava as much as he could. Though, he could only do so much against a group that outnumbered him and Ava had to raise her weapon to defend herself. Luckily, these skinks couldn't pose a threat to them, and they were all quickly killed. Like this, the two arrived back at the haven. Dirk dug up their bag of loot before walking into the haven and finding their hidden bags. After finding a comfortable place to sit, Dirk took out all the medical items and had Ava take off her armor. He checked all her wounds before cleaning them and wrapping them up. Normally, with how deep Ava's wounds were, she would have to go and get stitched up. However, after the situation with Kazma, Dirk and Ava had taken precautions. Before jumping into the dungeon, they had refilled on medical supplies and also bought some adhesive strips that could be used to temporarily seal wounds that needed to be stitched. Before wrapping, Dirk pinched her lacerations and threw these strips on, sealing them. After that, Ava insisted on checking Dirk's wounds. Taking off his shirt, she saw over a dozen individual lacerations that pierced into his flesh. These lacerations were caused by the lizard's teeth, and they created a line that went from his collarbone, down to his chest, around his arm, and then up around his back. However, Ava was shocked when she looked deeper at them. All of the cuts were sealed, as if the teeth had never pierced through his skin. What was left were red lines. Ava looked at him questioningly. It's a secret of mine. Dirk scratched his cheek with that reply. He wasn't able to really explain his nanites to her, regardless of whether he wanted to or not. She just wouldn't understand. It was easier to call it one of his secrets. He had a bunch already, so one more wasn't that bad. Ava looked at him conflictedly before sighing. After that, the two rested for a while. After Dirk set up a tent and had them eat, the two climbed onto their makeshift bed and went to sleep. The sun hadn't yet gone down, but after using so much anima to fight the king, both of them were exhausted. They fell asleep as soon as their heads hit their pillows. After around ten hours, both Dirk and Ava roused from their sleep. The surroundings were still dark, a result from them going to sleep so early and waking up even earlier. This wasn't a bad thing though. The two didn't speak as they climbed out of their tent and started packing things up. After eating, Dirk used his nifty new ring to store all their bags. With that, the two left the haven and walked back toward the dungeon entrance. This walk took two days. By the end of the second day, the duo stepped out of the dungeon and into the fresh night air of the town. After grabbing a room for the night, they slept before finding a merchant the next morning. Unfortunately, Dirk and Ava didn't have much money on them. After scrounging up the remaining gold they had, Dirk still had to toss in a few of the extra mana crystals he got to pay for a ride. While there was still a small discrepancy in the price, the merchant didn't haggle and let the two ride with him. With that, Dirk and Ava began their return home. The ride to the capital took two days, and during these two days, Dirk and Ava had nothing to do but be in each other's company. At the end of the second day though, they finally arrived. The two were excited as they passed through the city walls. The sun covered them in golden rays as their wagon parked and they hopped off. Without wasting time, the two rushed to the academy. Right now, both Dirk and Ava were a mess. All of their clothes had been torn and stained by blood, including the ones they had on. Not only that, but Ava was wrapped up in bandages as if she just got out of a hospital. They didn't care though as they walked straight toward the mission hall where they could turn in their mission. How can I help, you? A receptionist was stunned as she turned and saw the duo. When she went quiet, Dirk dropped a bag full of mana crystals on the counter along with a piece of paper. We finished our job. Oh? Seeing the items, the receptionist was surprised. She looked over the sheet of paper, reading the details and date of acceptance. This caused her to slightly frown though, 
and she took it with her to a back room. After a minute, she came back out. Seeing Dirk and Ava's expectant gaze, she shook her head. I'm sorry, but this job has already been completed. What? Hearing this, both Dirk and Ava were stunned. By who? A group of third years completed this job a bit over a week ago. Because your group took so long, we had reposted the job, and they took it before taking no more than six days to complete it. Third years. Wait, were they a group of four? Thinking for a second, Dirk asked. The receptionist nodded. Yes. Two men and two girls? Yes. Damn. Suddenly, Dirk cursed. Ava looked at him weirdly. When Kazma got wounded and we made it to that haven, there was another group there. That group took our job. Wait, seriously? Ava was stunned once more. She remembered that there was another group, but didn't pay attention to it. To think the group they happened to come across was actually the one who took the same job as them. They were competitors, and Dirk's group lost miserably. Dirk felt quite a bit of frustration, as did Ava. There was nothing they could do though. There had been setback after setback, and they had taken almost a month to complete this job. Even Dirk knew that such performance was unacceptable, and they got burned for it. Seeing their downcast faces, the receptionist felt bad. She knew that Dirk and Ava were only second years who had just started their dungeon diving career. Seeing their obviously wounded appearance, she knew things hadn't gone so easily either. They worked very hard on this job only to get it snatched from under their nose. Look, I can't give you the normal pay for the job, but we still buy mana crystals. You should have the 140 fire mana crystals. I'll take them for 100 gold. That's still higher than the normal conversion rate. Thank you. Hearing the offer, Dirk could only nod. While it was 70 gold less than they should have gotten, there was nothing he could do about taking so long. The receptionist quickly counted the crystals, and after finding a bit more than 140 crystals, handed Dirk and Ava 110 gold. With that, the two walked out of the mission building a bit downtrodden. Come on, let's get you taken care of. Dirk glanced at Ava before turning in another direction. She walked with him into the hospital building where she was taken by a nurse to go get stitched up. After waiting for an hour, Ava walked out and went with Dirk to his house. After arriving, the two took turns taking baths before making dinner. They ate a large meal that filled them up before Dirk handed Ava a healing potion. He also drank one, and the two ended the night sitting on the couch. After staring at the ceiling for a while, Ava turned her head and looked at Dirk. So what now? Take another job? Let's wait a bit. Dirk answered with a sigh. I'm close to advancing my tier and I need some time to practice. We also need to catch up with our classes. Mainly the magic ones. I don't think going to the animal one is necessary anymore. Hmm. I'm also getting close to advancing my tier. Hey, I heard the magic pyramid is good for that kind of stuff with their high-density mana rooms. Maybe we should try going there. Maybe. Dirk pondered before nodding. As he practiced his runes more, he found that it was harder to do so when he didn't have a high enough mana density. The denser the mana, the easier it was to create and control runes. If he wanted to form the full rune for his mana heart, then he would definitely need denser mana. The magic pyramid was the prime place for getting a dense mana environment, so he quickly decided to talk to his father about it. Well, for now, let's just rest. We can go back to classes tomorrow, and no working out until you heal. All right, all right. Dirk poked Ava's cheek, causing her to giggle in agreement. After that, the two fell asleep on the couch, Ava using Dirk's body as a cushion. Chapter 64, Spells It was now the fourth month into Dirk's second year at the academy. After he and Ava returned, they both went back to their peaceful routine of classes. Because neither of them saw any necessity in attending the anima classes, Ava only had two classes to go to. First was her water element class, and second was her alchemy class. 
As for Dirk, he still had five classes, one for each of his three elements and two for forging and enchanting. Dirk was met with a bit of a surprise change when he returned to class though. Because it was normal for students to disappear for weeks or even months, the teacher wasn't concerned about his sudden arrival. However, when Dirk was given an overview of what they were doing, he went deep into thought. The first year in the academy, all the element classes taught the same few spells that were basically the standard. However, from the second year on, they would begin to specialize. In his earth class, Dirk's teacher went over several different spells. All these spells were put in front of Dirk, and it was his job to choose one to learn. Mages couldn't learn absolutely every spell made available to them, so at a certain point, they would pick out spells they wanted to learn and focus on that until they felt they could move on. So, Dirk was required to pick a spell he wanted to learn and study it until he could cast it. As for the teacher, they were there to help with anything they couldn't understand. Everyone's understanding of magic was different, even though the runes were the same for each spell. Because of that, the academy took a hands-off approach in the later years, allowing students to form their own visions of magic and come to them if they ever needed special guidance. This was why, when it came to the third and fourth year students, the classes were never full. Nearly all students were either practicing magic on their own time, pursuing something like forging or alchemy, or dungeon diving. Through this, they carved their own path of magic. This didn't decrease the value of the academy in the slightest, however. The reason the academy could stand as one of the largest and most powerful institutions was because they held the largest repository of magical knowledge in the empire. There were thousands of spells across all the elements that were held exclusively by the academy, most of which were developed by the teachers and skilled mages within the academy walls. The academy was single-handedly responsible for creating the most powerful mages the empire has ever seen. Only an extremely few exceptions were able to rise to prominence by themselves, but even these people weren't completely cut off from the empire's influence. After all, mages needed resources, especially so as they became more powerful. The empire held all these resources. Now, Dirk was just beginning to understand this point. As he went through his classes, he needed to choose some spells to learn. However, these spells were only low-tier spells. If one wanted to learn some of the more powerful spells, they would need to provide a certain amount of value to the academy, and by extension the empire. If they refused to give anything, the academy had no obligation to hand over magical knowledge. This would cut off a mage's lifeline, and they would never be able to advance in power and status. For now though, Dirk didn't have to worry about this problem. In his earth class, he went through the spells made available to him before choosing one. There were several choices. One spell was called Phoenix Guard, and this spell would create a wall with dozens of spikes capable of impaling enemies and stopping a frontal charge. If Dirk had this spell, he would have been able to keep the Lizard King from charging him. Things like his rock arrows couldn't even pierce the Lizard's hide, but this spell was much stronger. It was a spell that required at least a tier 3 to cast. Dirk barely qualified to start practicing it. As for the others, there were things like a ground-shifting spell that would anchor Dirk to the floor and move the ground underneath his feet. This was an earth movement spell. There was also an improved version of the rock arrow spell. Many different spells with various effects were put in front of Dirk. After thinking for a while, he didn't make a choice, but instead asked the question. Are there any spells that make use of the metal specialization? Metal? Hearing his question, Dirk's teacher was surprised. The next moment though, she smiled bitterly. Unfortunately, we don't have any for your level. The spells we've brought out are the only ones you can choose from. I see. Dirk let out a light breath. This disappointed him. The metal specialty was undoubtedly powerful, but for now, he wasn't able to make use of it. He turned his focus back to the spells in front of him. In the end, he chose one. The spell was called Earth Guard, and it was a spell that created small pieces of armor that could protect a person's body. The Earth Guard spell was actually a series of spells that got progressively harder to cast as one got stronger. The spell Dirk chose was the most basic one, and it could only create a small section of armor to protect a single part of the body like the leg, 
chest, or arm. Dirk still chose it though. If Dirk had this spell, he would have been able to protect against the Lizard King's bite and swipes, using more than just his tough body and wearable armor. Besides, the earth element was more defensive in nature anyway. Dirk intended to use it as such. After that, Dirk scanned the book for the spell. When it came to these spells, the students weren't allowed to take them away from the classroom in order to keep the books from getting into the wrong hands. Luckily, Dirk could just scan it and go, never needing to touch the book again. After that, Dirk went to the fire class. Here, he was met with the same predicament. After many minutes of deliberation, Dirk picked out a spell. The spell was an improved version of the fireball. The difference though was that this new fireball spell would create a much more concentrated fireball. The fireball would be about the size of a marble, the power of fire compressed as much as possible. One could throw this fireball at high speeds, letting it explode with extreme power. It wasn't an area spell that could cover a range of enemies, but instead more like a grenade that could deal high damage to a few targets. The closer the enemy was to the fireball, the more damage. The biggest difficulty in this spell was compressing the fireball precisely. Many people with low affinities couldn't compress all the mana within the fireball, leading to some leaking and ultimately ruining the spell. To use this spell, one needed a high enough affinity so that they could control any leaks. Luckily, Dirk had no problems with that. With that, Dirk left the fire class. After that though was the dark class. Dirk stood outside the door for a few seconds, calming himself before facing the chaotic mess that was his teacher. However, while Dirk stood outside, the door to the classroom was flung open. Dirk was shocked when he was met with Geralt's beaming face. It's Dirk. Oh God. Everyone. Dirk has returned after an arduous and mythical adventure. Let us congratulate him and make Song of a Legendary Warrior come home. As Geralt started singing an actual song of legendary warriors, the three students in the classroom awkwardly clapped for Dirk. By now, they learned just to go along with this eccentric teacher of theirs. Dirk didn't blame them as he stood around with a twitching smile. When Geralt finally finished his wonderful song and Dirk was allowed to sit, the class was able to continue. At least, for Dirk it was. Like the other classes, Geralt spoke about several dark spells that Dirk could learn. Only, Geralt was totally focused on Dirk as he explained all the different spells, totally neglecting the other three students. To this, they didn't feel angry or upset. Being Geralt's favorite was more a curse than a blessing, and none of them wanted to be in his spotlight. While those three studied their spell books in relative peace, Dirk listened to Geralt lay out all the different spells he could learn. For once, Geralt even brought out books. However, Dirk was quickly shocked. These spells? I definitely shouldn't have access to them. Dirk blankly stared at the four books that Geralt put in front of him. All of them were some of the highest level spells in the academy. The spells Dirk picked out in his other classes were basic spells for tier 3 mages that consisted of no more than 3 or 4 magic circles. But these books contained spells that were designed for class 6 mages, containing dozens of magic circles. The books held the spells that started from tier 3, all the way up to tier 6. For example, Dirk was quick to spot the void walking spell. This spell was a dark movement technique that would teleport a mage short distances. This spell actually relied on using the unique spatial aspect of the dark element to perform. With this, one could actually bend space to move across it. The beginning spells required a tier 4 or an exceptional tier 3 to practice. At the tier 6 level, one could use this spell to teleport long distances. This book contained the entire spell from beginning to end. Dirk would be able to use this book to practice from now until he was a tier 6. Such a spell book was definitely off limits to him. And the others were very similar. Dirk saw another spell called Spatial Execution, and this spell would create tiers in space that could be used to slice through enemies. One needed to be at least a high level tier 5 to practice this, and there were spells for this at the tier 7 level. The other two spells were called Curse of Darkness and Dark Healing. 
The first one was a curse, and it almost acted as some kind of poison that one could attach to an enemy, slowly eating away at their vitality until they keeled over as a husk. The second was just as the title said, and it was a special healing spell aimed toward dark mages that were incompatible with the light element. However, while the cure of darkness could be practiced at tier 3, dark healing could only be practiced at tier 5. This was because dark healing was extremely special, and it required an in-depth understanding of the dark element. It wasn't a matter of sheer power, but comprehension. This was why there were so few dark healers. Light healers were everywhere, and even low-tier light mages like Alec could engage in light healing. This was because the light element was attuned to that sort of thing. But the dark element was the opposite, and to bend the nature of the dark element required a high level of understanding. Dirk looked over the four spell books. All of them comprised the entirety of the spell from the lowest tier to the highest. However, Dirk wasn't sure why Geralt would show him things like dark healing and spatial execution if he couldn't even begin practicing it. The only things he could even touch right now were Curse of Darkness and Void Walking. Dirk asked Geralt his question. However, the answer shocked him. I want you to take all of them. Why? So you can practice them in the future. Those greedy administrators always want to hog magical knowledge and force you into the military to practice them. Do you know how long it took for me to snatch these books? Three years. If it weren't for my amazing skill, I would have never been able to teleport these things out of the Academy's vault. If they're in your hands though, I can rest assured. No prodigy of mine shall be forced into the military for some simple spells like these. Dirk was silent as Geralt shook his fist righteously. With a blank face, he took out a cloth and wiped down the books he touched, clearing them of all fingerprints. He then put his hands in his pockets, refusing to touch them again. Aren't you going to take them? You can put them in that pocket ring of yours. Don't worry, the Academy doesn't even know these books are gone. No. Is it the shabby covers? If you want me to transcribe them, I can have some fresh books for you by tomorrow. They can even be metal. No. But Dirk, my precious student. These spells will be infinitely valuable to you. Or are they not to your liking? If you want, I can make a stop by the vault again. There was one forbidden spell similar to spatial execution that might tickle your fancy. No. But Dirk. After Dirk kept refusing to touch the illegal merchandise, Geralt became flustered. For the next several minutes, Geralt went on to explain the spells and how amazing they were, confessing to several serious crimes and possibly a capital crime in the process. At first, Dirk refused to listen to him. He didn't want to get caught up as an accomplice to this crazy man. However, as Geralt spoke more and more, Dirk hesitated. He looked at the four books in front of him. Then, after Geralt made a certain promise, Dirk's hesitation was mostly wiped away. If you wish, my precious student, I can transcribe and then destroy the books afterward. That way, nobody will ever be able to trace things back to you. After all, I couldn't have you waste 80 years of your life just for learning a so-called forbidden spell. What's so forbidden about spatial execution anyway? They just don't want people to succeed as a mage. Geralt shook his head with a huff. Hearing him, Dirk made a very difficult deliberation before nodding. Fine. Yes. Here, these are now yours. Return them to me when you wish. No no, you can hang on to them when I'm not using them. They will be safer in your hands. Dirk spoke seriously. Geralt asked him solemnly. Are you sure? Very. I understand. I shall guard these books with my life. Thank you. As Geralt took a pledge, Dirk's eye twitched before turning back to the books. Using the cloth to open them, Dirk spent the next hour flipping through each book. His AI scanned every page in its entirety. Dirk ensured that he would never have to come in contact with these books again. When he was done, he pushed the books back to Geralt. All right, you take them. Transcribe if you want and then destroy them. Or better yet, put them back and make it look like you never took them. Are you sure? What if you wish to study them more? I memorized them. 
I don't need to see them again. Really? Amazing. My student truly is a prodigy. Very well, I will take care of them. Right. Dirk nodded before standing. He was then quick to rush out of the classroom, Garrel seeing him off with another song about departing soldiers. I'm a criminal now. Let's hope I don't get burned for it later. As he walked to his next class, Dirk took a deep breath. Luckily, even if people did find out that Garrel stole the books, there was no way he would be implicated. He was just a kid who couldn't even practice half the spells Garrel showed him, and nobody would believe he truly memorized all the contents. That combined with Garrel's reputation ensured he would be safe. After that class, Dirk went over to his forging class. There he caught up on several forging techniques and even started a project to forge a sword. After an hour there, Dirk left for his enchanting class where he learned more enchanting theory. He also started a project here, one that required him to enchant something called a spell scroll which was a one-time use spell. These were commonly used by warriors who couldn't cast spells and relied on these consumable scrolls. They were relatively easy to produce, so the teacher had his classes start with these for practice. After another hour there, Dirk left. Finally, he was done for the day. However, there was one more stop he had to make. After going back to his own house and grabbing Ava who was already there, Dirk left for the administrator housing area. He was going to speak with his father. The two arrived at Riker's house as the sun sunk below the horizon. Dirk could smell a wonderful fragrance as he approached, obviously cooking. He knocked on the door and was let in by a maid. It's Dirk. You little boy, why didn't you tell us before you left on a dungeon dive? Come sit, we just made dinner. Seeing his son, Riker was surprised before inviting to the dinner table. Ava followed, and the three walked to the dining area where Cecilia was already seated. Hello mother. Hello my sweet child. Dirk hugged his mother before taking a seat. Ava also curtsied before sitting beside him. Riker chuckled as he took the head of the table while maids went and started preparing more food for the unexpected guests. So, you little daredevil, wanna tell me how your dungeon dive went? I would say it went well, but not only does Ava have bandages on, but a little birdie told me about your party member who is still recovering. It sounds like you had an exciting adventure. Cecilia leaned forward with a smile, hand under chin, as she asked Dirk. He scratched his head. It went all right. Ava and I stayed behind to complete the job, but it turns out that another group completed it before we returned. Oh? I'm sorry honey. I guess we've learned a lesson though about choosing proper group members, hm? Yes. Dirk nodded seriously. Alec was the only one who could keep up with them during that dungeon dive. Dirk would never again group up with people who couldn't pull their own weight, if not for no other reason than to keep people alive. Cecilia smiled at Dirk's seriousness. Good. Now, tell me about Ava's wounds. We fought the dungeon king and she got wounded. Ha! Huh. Hearing Dirk, Cecilia stiffened up. You went to the king's hall? Yes. Why would you do that? Going to the king's hall is a serious matter, and you two went in by yourselves? Yes? Dirk titled his head as Cecilia turned solemn. She looked at him with both worry and motherly anger. Dirk, honey, you do realize what entering the king's hall means right? That's a life or death battle, and you can't leave until either the king dies or you die. I understand that. So, why? because I felt confident in my chances. Dirk looked at his mother seriously. While Ava was the one who initially wanted to fight the king, he ultimately made the decision, and it was because he was confident in his ability to handle himself. As for Ava who wanted to take the blame, he didn't let her. Seeing his seriousness, Cecilia gazed at him for a few seconds before sighing. All right, I trust you. I guess since you're here right now, that means you succeeded. Just promise me you will never push yourself to fight any kings, okay? Yes, mother. Thank you. So? What were your rewards? I got this. Dirk raised his hand, slipping the pocket ring off his finger and handing it to his mother. 
Cecilia was surprised, able to quickly see what it was. A pocket ring. That's a fantastic reward for the lesser dungeon you were in. And four feet of space is a good amount. Congratulations. I thought we'd buy you one at some point, but it looks like we get to save some gold. Cecilia nodded as she handed the ring back to Dirk. Cecilia then turned to Ava, who lifted her necklace. I got this necklace. It's enchanted with a water mana crystal. I tested it and it gives a boost to water magic attacks. Oh? That's also impressive. Looks like your harvests were good. I'm proud. Oh, and Ava. Cecilia smiled at Ava. Thank you for fighting alongside Dirk. Trustworthy friends are hard to come by. I'm glad he has one. Oh, of course. Ava smiled sweetly. Getting praise from Dirk's parents meant a lot to her, especially with their statuses. Now, let's eat. After food began piling up on the table, the four started digging in. And when they finished eating, Dirk finally got down to business and mentioned the magic pyramid. C-65, Darkness. So you're close to advancing? The magic pyramid would indeed be a good place for you. After hearing his son's inquiry, Riker rubbed his chin in thought. All right. I'll get you in. In three days meet me there at sunrise. Bring anything you might need for anything you want to do. Understood. Can Ava join as well? Sure. I can arrange another room. Thank you, Mr. Strider. Hearing Riker's willingness to help, Ava gave her thanks. Riker smiled and nodded at her. With these plans made, Dirk and Ava finished eating before showing themselves out. The next few days, Dirk continued to go about his peaceful life. Neither he nor Ava did any training. Not only did Ava need to heal, but Dirk didn't believe any training would be effective. As their anima rank increased, he found that training became less and less beneficial. The normal human body would have to maintain consistent and constant training to retain its peak physical state. But with Anima, that fact diminished in truth. Anima maintained Dirk's monstrous stamina regardless of whether he trained or not. At the very least, Dirk could go a few weeks without training and likely not suffer any repercussions. So taking a few days off would be nothing more than a small rest. With that, he earnestly focused on his mana heart and magic. With his mind clear, Dirk found himself creating more and more runes required to create the mana heart rune. At the same time, he studied the extra material his enchanting teacher handed him, and he found many more inspirations and connected dots. He quickly advanced in skill and comprehension. As for the level of the mana heart itself, it had been at the cusp of advancing for a while now. Dirk had been holding back, refraining from practicing his mana lungs until he completed the rune. After that, it would only take a little nudge, and he would officially step into the Tier 3 realm. At times though, Dirk would find himself stuck while forming runes. When this happened, he switched to studying his spells. Two of the spells he glanced at were Void Walking and Curse of Darkness. Void Walking required a Tier 4 or Exceptional Tier 3 mage to practice. Dirk wasn't either of these things because he hadn't even formed his Earth Mana Heart, let alone his Dark Mana One, and Rita herself had only just begun using this technique when Dirk entered the Academy. After a year, she had taken a full step into the Tier 5 realm, and her void walking seemed to be perfect. However, Rita was a pure dark mage and a genius when it came to the dark element. Dirk's focus was split between enchanting, his other elemental spells, and anima. Training any one thing would take longer. Luckily, he at least had good affinities for his elements. This made training spells that much easier. In essence, everything required forming runes. Spellcasting, otherwise known as magic, was forming runes and attaching them to a magic circle, forming a closed circuit that could control and emit its power. The runes in these spells were merely instructions containing every detail of the movement of mana and the effects of its manifestation. Enchanting was also comprised of forming runes. One formed runes and then attached them to similar mana circuits, like code in a machine. 
However, the big difference between enchanting and spellcasting was that enchanting required one to attach mana to a physical object. It brought together the ethereal and material. Thus, it was many times more difficult to enchant than spellcast. One had to have the innate ability, though Derp disproved this misconception through the attainment of his, mana resonance, skill. Knowing this, Dirk came to form the understanding that the key to all things magic was runes. Thus, the way to become stronger was to increase one's ability to form runes. This required comprehension of one's elements. Runes were a magical language, one that communicated with and controlled the man around them. The runic language had long been established in this world. Countless books had been filled across millennia that constantly expounded on magical theory. Low-level spells had long been perfected, and everyone in this prosperous era was advantaged in that they merely needed to follow in the footsteps of their predecessors. Dirk knew that forming his own understanding of magic was important, but he also wasn't one to reinvent the wheel. As he enhanced his comprehensions, he constantly referred back to all the spell texts his AI had scanned and stored. He would often have visuals of the runes within the books displayed in his vision as he formed runes in the air. He would search for the meanings behind each and every line, angle, and connection as he sought to match the runes perfectly. For three days, Dirk did this. He and Ava both. Ava had picked out multiple water spells that she now studied. She and Dirk would lock themselves away in his magic workshop with a denser mana environment, and there would constantly be flashes of light as magical lines formed themselves at the behest of their masters. Dirk and Ava's fingers fluttered around, mana tracing along their tips. For Ava, sitting and spending hours practicing spells and cultivating mana wasn't a new thing. Unlike Dirk, she only had anima, alchemy, and a single element to train. With Dirk's three element classes, enchanting and forging classes, and then his obsession with physical training, he never dedicated a lot of time to training magic. Until now, it had only been a supportive thing he used. His physical body was still his go-to weapon. But now, Dirk was dedicating all his time to studying magic, plunging into the fathomless depths of its profundity. At first, Dirk had trouble spending more than a couple hours or so at a time practicing magic. But on the second day, he went for an entire twelve hours, never ceasing to form runes and study them. Not even Ava could spend so long concentrated on one thing and she had spent many more hours than Dirk practicing magic. Dirk's concentration had surprised her. However, with how many secrets he had and the amazing things he was capable of, this much wasn't enough to shock her. She was only impressed by his sheer, absolute focus. Though, perhaps what was more shocking was his endurance. Practicing magic consumed energy, and a lot of it. It was a big limiter for Ava and she could only go several hours with light energy usage at most before wanting to fall into a deep sleep from exhaustion. But Dirk seemed to have endless mental energy. He formed runes non-stop, moving from one train of thought to another without any breaks. Ava could maintain such energy consumption for perhaps a few hours, a mere fraction of what Dirk could. Unbeknownst to her, a part of this discrepancy was due to their mana cultivation methods. Dirk's could be called one of the best especially for him who had multiple attributes. It came from Duke Hillshire who had received it as a gift from the Emperor himself. Such a gift was anything but ordinary, and it had been handed down to Dirk as its sole practitioner due to its strenuous requirements. Though, a large part of the discrepancy between them was caused by their differences in talent. While it wasn't an absolute fact that more attributes indicated greater talent, it was a rather reliable indicator. Those with multiple attributes, or one of the rare light or dark attributes, regularly surpassed their peers at the same level. Dirk not only had three attributes, but the dark attribute was one of them. All of them had high affinities too. His talent could be called unrivaled. For him to display such amazing feats of magical stamina wasn't at all uncalled for. However, Ava couldn't truly see the extent of Dirk's talent or rapid pace of comprehension. Not even Dirk knew how much or how quickly he was advancing. All Dirk could feel while practicing for twelve hours straight was this sense of wonder. This wonder grew and grew, until he entered an ethereal state. 
his mind seemed to become one with the man around him as all these comprehensions permeated into his soul. He felt like he was directly communicating with mana itself, understanding its language and forming a deeper connection with it. When he entered this state, those twelve hours passed incredibly quickly. Dirk felt himself fall deeper and deeper into the deep end of this mystical enlightenment. However, as he fell further and further down, he suddenly felt a certain darkness creep up and reach out to him. There were dark tendrils that wished to reach out and pull his soul down into the abyss below, infecting him with chaos. For a while, Dirk didn't seem to care about this. It felt good to just let go and bask in the wonder of discovery. But then, something within him lit up. Dirk's mind snapped to lucidity, and he realized what was happening. Feeling himself about to be lost to that darkness, he gritted his teeth and fought back. The light of his soul shone brightly on the darkness that had almost wrapped around him. Only, this light didn't burn it away, but rested away control. Dirk utilized his mind and will to control and convert this darkness to his own, making it a part of him. He had realized that this darkness, although it sought to infect him, still contained comprehensions of the element. He felt a desire for this as he still felt as if he were being enlightened. When he took control though, he understood something. The darkness around him was the embodiment of the dark element. This darkness acted as if it were alive, and that was in fact the truth. Dirk had long wondered why people like Geralt who were dark mages were as chaotic as they were. He had concluded that something about the dark element drove them to be that way. Now, he realized that this was it. To meditate on magic was to plunge into its depths, subjecting yourself to it and gleaning secrets. But if you did that with the dark element that seemed alive, you risked giving some of yourself up to it. To understand the dark element was to subject yourself to its nature, thus allowing you to understand its nature and wield it. But this led to the person in question becoming a little bit insane. The chaos of the dark element infected that person, changing who they were. But these people wouldn't care since they attained more power, so they willingly did so. Dirk didn't want that though. He, above all others, hated discord. He was quite the opposite of chaotic. He was orderly, strict. He sought understandable patterns and predictability. Even in battle, a time of chaos, he found order and calculated risk. He would never hand himself to chaos. He was a man of discipline. And when the darkness sought to infect him with its filthy chaos, he didn't just push it away, but rebelled. He injected himself into the darkness, taking the power for himself. It was almost like his soul was burning as his very being took control of this foreign invader. When that happened, there was a low roar. In that sea of man around Dirk, everything shook. The darkness then revealed deep black eyes that stood out even in the abyss, looking at Dirk with hostility. He gazed back. It revealed endless nothingness and anarchy. It contrasted greatly against Dirk's bright soul, and it wanted nothing more than to eat him, turning him into its vessel but it couldn't. With that roar, the tendrils that weren't taken over by Dirk retracted. Then, Dirk was ejected from his ethereal state, returning to reality. Arg! Opening his eyes, Dirk let out a loud grunt. His hands grabbed his head as a stabbing pain shot through it. He fell and writhed on the floor. While he had taken over some of the darkness that sought to infect him, it had come at a great price. Compared to the being that controlled the very dark element itself, Dirk was absolutely nothing. The tiniest modicum of its power had caused him to overexert himself in order to fight it. Dirk? What happened? Not far from Dirk, Ava was stunned. She had been practicing peacefully when he suddenly yelled. This shocked her, causing her heart to jump out of her chest. Dirk wasn't easily harmed and if he couldn't handle pain, it was unknown how amazingly deep that pain had to be. Gah! Ha! Hey! What's going on? Dirk continued to exclaim in pain on the floor. Now, Ava was scared a bit as she could only watch. Thankfully, Dirk seemed to get his pain under control as his grunts died down. After a few minutes, he was quiet except for his heavy breaths. I'm, fine. Dirk spoke to Ava who continued to sit beside him. There was still a sharp pain in his head, 
but that much he could deal with. He took a few deep breaths as he sat against a wall, his limbs limp as if he were dying. Are you okay? What happened? Ava moved over, taking a handkerchief out of her pocket and wiping his forehead that was now dripping sweat. Learning from Dirk, she had also started carrying one. I was only meditating, if you could call it that. But, there was this darkness that wanted to grab me. It was the dark element. The dark element? How did it grab you? It was alive. Dirk shuddered a bit as he remembered the encounter. While he had a battle-hardened mind that wouldn't be faced even in the face of death, in front of that dark existence, he felt amazingly insignificant. That existence could be likened to some kind of god, one that ruled over an entire element. To be gazed at by that being caused his very soul to shake. Thankfully he got out quickly. The element was alive. It wanted to grab me, but I fought it. Fighting it, took a lot out of me though. I'll be fine. Just need some sleep. Dirk muttered as fatigue rapidly overtook his mind. Ava was worried as she supported his body that started to tilt. I. Are you sure you're okay? I can go get your parents. No, they can't do anything. I wasn't hurt, only a bit shaken. I just need rest. Sorry, for worrying you. Hm. At that moment, Dirk's body went soft as he laid against Ava. She heard his shallow breathing and knew he had fallen asleep. Seeing that, she sighed before grabbing his body, picking him up and carrying him to his bedroom. After laying him in his bed, Ava felt a bit of fatigue set in too. She had also been practicing all day and was tired. As for eating, she had sat motionless for hours, so she wasn't even hungry. Deciding that she was too tired to care, Ava slipped into the bed as well. Her heart beat a bit in nervousness, but as they had slept in even closer proximity before, Ava didn't mind that much. After a minute or so, she lost herself in the warmth and comfort of the bed while worriedly watching Dirk's sleeping face, falling deep asleep herself. That night, Dirk's mind didn't just sleep. When Dirk fell unconscious, he felt himself plunge back into that ocean of mana. Many different mages had many different visions of what mana was to them. To practice magic was to subject yourself to it, and while doing this, one usually visualized their experiences in different ways. Mana could be considered a dimension in and of itself. It existed alongside the material world, permeating through all facets of existence. When one communicated with mana, they used their souls to communicate with this dimension. While doing this, they experienced this dimension and visualized it in their own unique way. For Dirk, he saw it as an ocean with an endless depth. This ocean was comprised of the mana he could see. Even as a child, Dirk had come to see mana as an ever-present fluid around him, like air. He could see endless seas of fire, lightning, rock, and metal. Then, there was darkness. When Dirk had lost himself in enlightenment, he had fully plunged into this ocean of elements. However, when he lost himself, darkness struck, and he was forced to fight back. Now, as Dirk dreamed, he found himself back in this ocean of mana. Looking down, Dirk could see that endless depth, a void of chaos. He floated above this void amidst the other ordered elements like earth and fire. For a while, Dirk wondered why he was back in this ocean. Then, he saw those two eyes of nothingness open back up in the void. They bore into Dirk's soul with unsuppressed hostility, but also curiosity. A pure soul. Suddenly, Dirk heard a voice. The voice was horrible to hear, both grating and terrifying. Dirk would cover his ears, but this voice pierced directly into his soul, imprinting the voice into his mind. It caused him to grit his teeth. You will be mine. You cannot fight me. Give up your soul, and become my vessel. You will wield limitless power. This voice spoke again. Dirk was shocked to hear this. This was the voice of the darkness. This was the will of the dark element. Dirk had never heard anything about communicating with an element before. Then, he suddenly realized that this was the source of the whispers he heard when losing himself in his lust for battle. It was the source of temptation. Dirk was able to quickly surmise what was going on. 
It was an offering. Dirk's pure soul, this will wanted it. A perfect vessel capable of limitless growth, there was no better deal. Dirk could attain limitless power, grasping the very source of the dark element, becoming the ultimate dark mage. Dirk would surpass even his sister, who to the current him, was an insurmountable existence. But, that would require giving himself up. This could be described with a single sentence. Selling your soul to the devil. Come to me, and grasp my secrets. Through me, you will ascend. You will become a god. Just let yourself sink. Let go, and bask in my endless darkness. Dirk gritted his teeth as more words came into his mind. At the same time, tendrils of darkness crawled up to him. They morphed into dozens of hands that wished to pull Dirk down. Before these hands could touch him though, Dirk looked straight into the eyes of that darkness. His lips curved into a sneer, though it was a pain one. Get the hell away from me. I'll grasp your secrets on my own. You wanna come and eat me? Just wait for me to go down there myself. When I do, I expect a full course meal. Insolence. There was a rumbling as the ocean of mana shook with a shockwave. Dirk's soul lit up once more, and he reached out to take some of the darkness that reached out to him. However, this darkness instead formed a small bullet that shot out at him. This little bundle of darkness flung Dirk away as the tendrils retreated. I will have your soul. Dare to encroach on my territory, and you will feel my wrath. You will never wield my dark element as long as I exist. Be gone. Suddenly, a wave of power crashed into Dirk. His soul was ejected from the ocean of mana. Since he had already drained his energy once, he didn't have the power to fight this small attack from that dark being. Ag. What? In the real world, Dirk suddenly shot up with a scream. Ava woke up instantly, her heart almost stopping from the shock. She looked over at Dirk who panted heavily. Reaching over, she turned on a light. When the light illuminated Dirk's face though, Ava was shocked. There was blood streaming from his nose, eyes, and mouth. H. Hey, what's going on? Ava carefully reached out. She was a bit fearful though. This was twice now that she had been scared. But now, she was a bit scared of Dirk. She looked at his face that sported a hateful stare. Dirk's teeth were gritted as he stared off into space, almost as if he were glaring at his ultimate nemesis. With his heavy pants, he looked like he was going to kill someone. Eventually, he calmed down though. When blood dripped from his chin to his chest, Dirk rubbed his face and saw that he was bleeding. Scowling, he got up and went to the bathroom, washing up. Chapter 66 Magic Pyramid Status. As Dirk turned on the water faucet and washed his face, he openly spoke to his AI, too angry to care about how weird he sounded to Ava. Minor damage to circulatory system caused by sudden mana surge. Time to repair, 22 hours. Shit. Dirk scoffed. When his soul had been hit by that wave of energy, the mana that was present throughout his blood was excited, leading to a small surge and bursting of some blood vessels. This was nothing major and only caused a bit of stinging pain. But Dirk didn't care about that. Damned darkness, trying to take over my soul. Just wait till I come back there. When I do, I'm having squid for dinner. Dirk? Hmm. Hearing his name called, Dirk raised his head and looked back. He saw Ava, dressed in some loose clothes and staring at him with some fear and worry. His anger died down a little seeing her, and he sighed before continuing to wipe his face. Sorry. I'm fine. Really? Yes. The next time this happens, I won't be the only one getting hurt. Oh. Ava went silent hearing his vengeful statement. As he finished wiping the blood off his face, she walked over to him with a towel. When he turned, she lifted the towel to his face, drying it for him. He looked at her as she wiped off the dripping water. Just be careful. With whatever you're fighting. Ava whispered as she finished with a wipe to his cheek. She didn't know what this darkness was or how it was going about taking over Dirk's soul, but she knew he was fighting something. 
she didn't need explanations, only his safety. Hearing her worry, Dirk felt warm on the inside. He reached out his arm, pulling Ava into a hug. She was surprised, but accepted it with a smile. After a while, they separated. Despite the recent attack and shooting pain in his head, Dirk looked to be in a good mood. He looked at Ava and smiled. So, what are you doing here? You, uh, well, I just thought I'd rather sleep here than walk to my dorm. You know what, consider it payment for me having to carry you up here after you passed out. You're heavy. After being embarrassed for a second, Ava gathered her wits and poked back at him. He chuckled and took the towel from her hands, throwing it to the side before nudging her out of the bathroom. After that, the two crawled back into the still warm bed. After Ava playfully scooted closer to him, they too went back to sleep. This time, there were no more disturbances as Dirk fell into a deep slumber, getting some much-needed recovery. The next day, Dirk woke up to the beeping sound of his AI's alarm clock. Normally, Dirk would be ready to jump out of bed and get on with the day. However, when he was rudely awakened, he frowned. His head still throbbed in pain, clearly not totally recovered from the successive attacks of the night before. Luckily, there was still another hour until sunrise. Using this time, Dirk remained laying on the bed with Ava on top of him, going into a little session of meditation. He closed his eyes and utilized his mana lungs, breathing the atmospheric mana in and out. This caused his head to sting, but like working out a sore muscle, it was a good way to help him recover. Finally, an hour passed. Dirk opened his eyes, turning his head. Hey! Wake up! Mm. Looking over, Dirk shook Ava. She moaned, not wishing to leave the deep comfort of the bed. Dirk rolled his eyes. You dork! Ah! With a pinch to her ribs, Ava was jolted awake. Her arm swung, batting away Dirk's hand that tickled her side. His eyebrow raised at her surprisingly violent response. Oh? Are you ticklish? Absolutely not. Whoosh. Ava suddenly flung the blankets off of her, jumping out of bed with surprising agility. She landed in a fighting stance, facing Dirk. He grinned. Your body language says otherwise. I have no idea what you're talking about. Heh. Sure. Come on then. Let's get ready to go. Sunrise is in five minutes. Huh. Five minutes? I had to recover for longer than normal. Dirk spoke as he climbed out from under his sheets. Ava's mood slightly darkened as she recalled the events of last night. She sighed and straightened out. Right. How are you feeling? Small headache. Now go change. Don't want to keep my father waiting. All right, all right. With that, Ava left the room. As she had come to stay at Dirk's house many times, she had a stash of clothing in his guest bedroom. She rushed to quickly change. A couple of minutes later, the two were walking out of the house. In their hands were rations from their recent dungeon dive. As they couldn't make food and they hadn't eaten last night, both of them were hungry, so they grabbed some dried meats they had stored. After several minutes, the two of them approached a building. Ava and Dirk gnawed on their strips of dry meat as they gazed up at the Magic Pyramid. The Magic Pyramid was one of the greatest magical structures in the Academy. Its entire purpose was facilitating magical advancement for students and staff alike. The building was an actual pyramid about 300 meters tall and 600 meters wide constructed of countless metal bricks. Every single metal brick was enchanted with dozens of elemental circuits that glowed and were interwoven together, forming a vast enchantment that covered the entire building. It was truly a sight to behold, a testament to the wealth and power of not only the Academy, but the Horizon Empire. At the base of this pyramid, there was a large set of doors. Despite it being so early in the morning, there were dozens of people moving in and out of the place. Dirk and Ava walked through the doors, finishing off their last bites of meat. Dirk! Over here! When they walked through, Riker was there to wave them down. Dirk and Ava approached. This way! Beckoning, Riker led them to a large staircase. 
the three ascended to the third floor. This wasn't even halfway up the building, and yet the mana density had already increased to levels that surpassed Dirk's magic workshop. There are two ways to utilize the magic pyramid. Riker spoke as they walked down a large hall. Doors lined the walls, each one leading to rooms filled with mana. The normal way is to pay for each day of room use using gold or other items of value, such as mana crystals. The other uncommon way though is to pay a lesser fee and supply your own mana crystal. Each of these rooms use mana crystals to increase the ambient mana density. If you pay for the normal way, the academy supplies both the room and the crystal. But if you have your own mana crystals, you can use them instead, only paying for the room. In here. Suddenly, Riker stopped and pointed to a room. After opening the door with a special metal key card, he led the two inside. Upon walking inside, the three found that although the mana was dense, it was actually lesser than the mana density in the hallways. Dirk and Ava looked around. The room had metal floors and walls with only two sources of light that brightened up the rather desolate room. In the middle of the room were some comfortable-looking chairs along with a thick mat on the floor and even a bed with only a mattress. If Dirk didn't know any better, he would think this was some kind of crappy hotel that one rented by the hour. Everyone's focus was quickly drawn to the back of the room though. There sat a large pedestal. On this pedestal was a large bowl that was covered in dozens of enchanted lines that converged at the bottom of the bowl. The lines on the bowl extended down the pedestal and into the floor where they spread out across the ground and walls. This place was a huge singular enchantment. To use your own mana crystals and activate the room's enchantments, you just need to throw the mana crystals into the bowl. Like so. Riker walked over to the pedestal as he spoke and took out a mana crystal. The large marble between his fingers fluctuated with heavy earth mana, obviously an earth element mana crystal. Then, he simply dropped it into the bowl. When it settled at the bottom, the enchantment glowed and activated. The lines throughout the room glowed green as mana filled the atmosphere, becoming denser and denser by the second. In only a minute, the room was filled to the brim with heavy earth mana. You can even do multiple elements. Suddenly, Riker dropped a fire mana crystal into the bowl. When it settled next to the earth mana crystal, the room was rapidly filled with fire mana just as dense as the earth mana, raising the temperature by a few dozen degrees. Taking a deep breath, Dirk felt his soul feel rejuvenated among the super-dense mana. He could feel every wave in the atmosphere as it brushed past his soul. His mana heart also responded positively. If Dirk really wanted to, he could take a few minutes to break through to Tier 3. But he couldn't yet. Calming down, he looked at his father. How long can I stay here? Since not many people like to use these rooms, I was able to reserve it for two weeks. Thank you. Of course. Use this time well. Here's a dark mana crystal to add on top of the other elements. Now, I'll leave you to your devices. I'll come back in four days to replace the mana crystals. As for you Ava, I'm sure staying in this environment is a bit suffocating for you. Your room is right next door. Come. Saying that, Riker waved Ava out. She bid Dirk goodbye before following Riker to the next door room where he dropped in a water mana crystal and filled the room with water mana. Before Riker stepped out though, he spoke to Ava. By the way, I've spoken with your parents. Mm. Ava's eyebrow raised as her parents were brought up. Riker spoke casually. I'll be honest. Doing things like reserving this room and supplying mana crystals, while not a hassle, doesn't come for free. It's nothing you have to worry about, but I felt that you should know that your parents are going to pay for any services you get from me. More specifically, those mana crystals are tier 5 crystals and cost a few hundred gold. Along with the room, the cost is more than you'll make by yourself after a few jobs. However, your parents already know this much and have agreed to this arrangement. I, I see. Hearing this, Ava was a bit surprised before turning a bit awkward. She knew that this was likely the case, but being confronted about it by Riker made her a little intimidated. She didn't forget that he was a Marquis, an entire level above her parents. While Dirk couldn't care less about status, 
she was sensitive to it. His services came at a price. Seeing Ava's awkward response, Riker just chuckled. It's okay. Believe me when I say that this is normal. Your parents are naturally going to invest in your growth, especially since you are their only child. Only, since I'm here to give assistance, they simply pay me instead of handing you the money to figure things out yourself. It makes things simpler for you. And I have no problem with doing this. I just wanted to make you aware. There's no need for any ambiguity in my eyes. Right. Thank you, Mr. Strider. Sure. Anyway, I'll leave you to it. Should you wish to continue practicing magic at that time, I'll be back in four days to replace the crystals. You can go in and out as you wish during that time. Here's the key card to this room. Thank you. Ava thanked Riker again as he handed her the metal key card to this room. With that, nobody would be able to enter even if she was gone, and she would have unrestricted access to the room. After that, Riker left. He stopped by Dirk's room once more, doing the same and giving him the key card before leaving. Like that, Dirk and Ava began a long magic training session by themselves. HM doesn't seem like I can enter that state whenever I want. At least not yet. After Dirk was left alone, he went on to practice for around four hours. During this time, he subjected himself to all the mana in the room, constantly drawing runes for his spells and enchanting. However, when he attempted to throw himself back into that ocean of mana, he encountered resistance. That ocean of mana wasn't simply a miraculous state of enlightenment. Dirk wasn't sure about the specifics, but he knew that it was like another dimension. Dirk called it the mana dimension, since it was where this ocean of mana was. To enter this mana dimension, Dirk would have to cast his awareness into his soul, thus entering the dimension. In that place, he would have the greatest awareness of mana and thus the fastest practicing speed. But to cast his awareness into the mana dimension was easier said than done. He found that he couldn't enter it even after attempting to for hours. However, in that time he discovered some sort of wall that blocked him from doing so. At first he thought this wall was created by that dark being that was giving him trouble. But he soon found that this wall was simply a natural resistance to Dirk doing something not so natural. To cast awareness to one's own soul wasn't supposed to be easy or casually done. Dirk had done so by luck the day before since he had gotten so engrossed in his practice. Now, to do it intentionally would require lots of practice, and perhaps more luck. Either way, Dirk couldn't easily enter. But perhaps that was a good thing. He didn't need to have any more run-ins with that dark being, and that might happen if he constantly appeared in that dimension. Although, there was something else Dirk discovered while trying to enter that dimension. Deep within himself, within his soul, he could feel a small formation. It was like a seed waiting to grow into something more. Dirk could intuitively feel it, and he knew this would form itself more over time. Was this that thing my mother talked about a long time ago? A stigma, right? Interesting. He mused to himself. With that, Dirk settled himself and practiced the normal way. At least with this dense mana, his practice speed wasn't that much slower than while in the ocean of mana. In fact, if it were practicing creating runes, doing it normally was faster than when in the mana dimension. The mana dimension granted Dirk elemental comprehension. But when it came to writing the runes, Dirk actually needed to do it himself consciously to make the most progress. Figuring this out, Dirk wasn't so bummed about not being able to enter that dimension. For several hours, he went on to form runes non-stop. For the most part, he focused on forming his mana heart runes since that was his top priority. Variation was good though, so he also threw in some spell practice. Like this, Dirk made fantastic progress toward making the mana heart rune. Surprisingly, taking a dip in the mana dimension the day before seemed to have greatly increased his elemental comprehension. Many runes he couldn't create or find the meanings of were solved as he went through them again and even more would be solved as he spent more time practicing. He underestimated his harvests from the day prior. This got him excited. At some point though he became hungry. Taking a break, Dirk left his room before finding a cafeteria within the magic pyramid. 
since many people would spend days and weeks in this place, it was only natural that there was a place to eat. After all, walking home or to a restaurant was a big waste of time. This helped maximize training time. As for Ava, Dirk didn't bother her. They practiced for different amounts of time and likely wouldn't cross paths as long as they were focusing. That was okay though. Practicing magic was an important part of every mage's life, and to achieve peak concentration, they would be reclusive for long periods of time. Handling a bit of loneliness was a part of the job. If anything, it helped develop patience, an exceptionally important trait of any great mage. Chapter 67 Advancement With seemingly endless time to himself, Dirk was quick to dive into work. Every day his room would constantly flash with the lights of elemental mana. He made rapid progress with forming his new spells. Since his Earth Guard spell could be practiced anywhere, Dirk had made great progress with it. He was actually able to form a light piece of rock armor around his arm, one that could be reinforced by his large Earth Mana Reserve. This success made Dirk feel accomplished. As for Dirk's improved fireball spell, that couldn't be practiced as he wished as it was a destructive spell, so other than forming the runes, he never practiced actually activating it and ensuring it worked. Luckily, this problem was solved when Riker came back to replace the mana crystals. After draining their mana, the mana crystals were reduced to nothing more than a fancy clear marble that was disposed of by the room's enchantment. It wasn't long after this happened that Dirk's door opened, revealing Riker's figure. Dirk stood from the chair that he came to prefer sitting in while practicing. Father. Dirk. How's practice coming along? I've improved. I have a question though. Is there a place where I can freely cast fire spells? There is. Riker nodded as he dropped some fresh mana crystals into the bowl, filling the room back up with dense mana. The first underground floor. There you'll find some open practice areas as well as isolated areas. Show them your key card and you'll be allowed into one of the isolated areas. It comes free with your third floor room. I see. Thank you. Of course. I'll be back in four days to replace the crystals again. Find me if you need anything. With that, Riker left again. Dirk spent some more time in the room before finding his way to the practice area. The practice area was totally underground, and like everywhere else, all constructions were made from those enchanted metal bricks. Dirk was stunned when he learned that this magic pyramid extended several floors deep. This meant that the resources required to construct such a thing were even more astronomical than he first thought. After talking to a nice receptionist, Dirk was allowed into one of the underground rooms. The room he had was quite a bit larger than he first thought it would be. However, the mana density wasn't nearly as high, only a bit denser than normal atmospheric mana. This was a place to practice casting spells. Naturally, spells would usually be cast in a place that didn't have artificially high mana densities, like outside. It forced one to rely more on their mana pool. Of course, get a higher level room and one would be able to practice with high mana density as well. Dirk didn't worry about this stuff as he stepped into the room. On one side of the room there were some large metal tablets that looked like targets. These tablets were enchanted to take all kinds of beatings. The chances of destroying one were very low. Raising his hand, Dirk concentrated. The fire mana that saturated his body was sucked out moving toward his hand like fiery snakes. Dirk watched every single particle and strand of fire mana congeal above his palm. Then, they went on to form three circles that stacked on top of each other. After this, the fire mana formed lines and runes that placed themselves along the lines of the circles. When these runes fused with the mana circles, they formed circuits that mana systematically flowed throughout. Until the circuit was completed and formed a closed loop, there would be resistance to forming the spell since the mana would want to fly out of control. One would need to control the mana within every rune and circuit until it was complete. Soon, Dirk was close to doing this. Out of the many runes within each circle, he had formed a majority. However, when he reached the end and formed the last rune, the mana circuit didn't close. It remained open as the loop refused to connect. Dirk frowned at this. 
This phenomenon meant that his circuit was messed up, and not just in one place. Several of his runes were incorrect or misdrawn. This would lead to a chaotic flow in the mana, and the spell would ultimately fail. In bad cases, the spell would go berserk and backfire. Before this happened, Dirk dissipated the mana, letting some of it release into the air while bringing most of it back into his body. Dirk's fire mana pool wasn't nearly as large as his earth mana pool. Any fire mana he expended would take a while to recover, so he recycled it despite the consumption of energy this took. With that, he began to ponder his mistakes. Pictures of the runes from the spell book Dirk scanned were displayed in his vision. Like that, Dirk created and overlapped runes, trying to find his mistakes. When he felt confident, he went back to form the spell. However, the second time wasn't much better than the first. He lost some fire mana as he dissipated the failed spell. This continued for a few hours. However, at some point, Dirk's fire mana pool ran dry. While he could pull fire mana from the atmosphere, it wasn't dense or plentiful enough to form the spell. He left the practice area with a downtrodden face. But he perked back up upon re-entering his room. There, he went back to forming runes for his mana heart. In this, he was making reliable progress. Dirk's practice went on for twelve total days. For the most part, he focused on enchanting while reserving time for spells. He continued to perfect his Earth Guard spell while actually coming to succeed in his improved Fireball spell. These two spells, once completed, were logged by Dirk's AI. Dirk called them Earth Guard and Fireball 2.0 respectively. When this happened, Dirk felt thankful for his AI. His AI was extraordinarily useful in battle where he had used it a lot. Especially in the dungeon, he had frequently called upon his AI to cast spells for him in order to ensure reliability. Surprisingly though, when it came to the Earth Guard spell, Dirk couldn't escape having to half-cast it. The AI could log the core runes and circuits, but he had to input the parameters for it like armor placement and shape. Coming to this point, Dirk had thought about trying to form a spell that would cover his entire body in a single piece of rock armor. However, this brought up countless other difficulties that he wasn't willing to tackle at the moment. Dirk's advancement in spells was definitely amazing. However, this was nothing compared to his advancement in enchanting. After these twelve days, Dirk was finally able to form the rune for his mana heart. The rune for Dirk's mana heart was comprised of several dozen runes that fused together, forming a large singular rune. After a while, Dirk had used his enhanced elemental comprehension to succeed in forming all the runes. Then, he practiced fusing them together. His constant advancement never ceased as he completed everything in one go. Coming to this point, Dirk was regretting not spending much more time on magic in the past. He had taken it as only supplementary, but now he was beginning to see how truly profound it was. His incessant physical training made him look like some kind of meathead brute. At least now though, he was finally coming to truly understand the world of magic. And when he finally dove in, the result was an unrivaled training speed. And now, he was going to take another step forward. With the rune complete, Dirk only needed to enchant it to his mana heart. While this would pose its own difficulties, it was nothing he didn't believe he couldn't tackle on the spot. Dirk spent an entire day relaxing, eating, and sleeping, recovering completely before closing himself up in the room once more. Here, he sat down in one of the comfortable chairs and got to work. Dirk looked off into space. Bringing his hands up, his fingers fluttered in the air, leaving behind traces of mana that came together to form runes. For several minutes, Dirk formed several dozen runes that floated in the air. Then, with waves of his hands, they all came together in a certain arrangement. Dirk then started connecting them one by one, forming one large complex rune. When he was done, the rune flashed as mana circulated through the entire thing. The rune held itself together in a formation of harmony. The only reason it would fall apart was if it lost all its mana or was intentionally destroyed. Dirk looked at the rune with a smile. The rune was about the size of his fist, and yet there were so many intricate lines comprised of many other tiny runes. After a few seconds, this rune seemed to contract and expand on its own, almost manifesting its function. 
Closing his eyes, Dirk focused on his mana heart. His mana heart was a core of earth mana on top of his physical heart. Seeing this, Dirk moved his focus to the rune in front of him. Grabbing it, he pushed the rune into his chest. After the rune entered his chest, Dirk guided it to the mana heart. The rune was a bit bigger than the heart, but this was okay. Dirk recalled the instructions for this process in the mana heart technique book and continued. Slowly, the rune floated to his mana heart. Then, the two touched. Earth mana was infused into the rune as the rune slowly wrapped around the heart, covering it up. What was left was a green core of mana with bright lines wrapped around it. But this wasn't all. Now that the two were on top of each other, Dirk needed to enchant the heart. He called upon his skill. Mana Resonance This was a grade 5 skill that allowed one to bind mana to material. However, Dirk was using this to bind mana to mana. He hoped it would work the same way. As he applied this skill, the mana that constructed the rune began to fluctuate. At first it didn't work, only disturbing the mana of Dirk's earth mana heart. But after he began to sift through the frequencies, the rune started to merge into the mana heart, becoming one with it. Seeing this small success, Dirk was excited. He continued to hone in on the correct frequency with his AI. Finally, the two matched, and the rune was fused with the mana heart. This process took several minutes. When the fusion was done, Dirk shook a bit as his mana heart contracted. At first it was out of sync with his physical heart. But after a minute, the two matched up. The mana heart glowed as it beat alongside Dirk's physical heart, the two acting as one. Dirk felt ecstatic as he felt his mana heart being to passively accumulate. However, this wasn't the end. With this accumulation, Dirk found something within and change. He could feel his soul fluctuate, as if about to break through a barrier. Surprised, Dirk quickly closed his eyes, concentrating on that feeling. Back when Dirk had first come to this room, he found that there was a barrier between him and the mana dimension, a barrier that prevented him from easily casting his awareness into his soul. But now, Dirk felt his soul fluctuate. Riding off this feeling, Dirk spent almost half an hour casting his awareness into his soul. Then, he opened his eyes. What was around Dirk was not the barren metal room, but an ocean of mana. This was the mana dimension, and Dirk had entered it once more. Unfortunately, Dirk didn't have the time to bask in the wonders of the man around him. He concentrated on his soul. A mage's advancement came with two different phenomena. The first was a change in one's profile. The profile reflected each person's mana level as tiers, and upon advancing, one's tier would go up. For Dirk, he was moving from tier 2 plus to tier 3 dash. But there was a more tangible change as well. This change was usually different from person to person and the reason was because of the different mana techniques each mage trained in. However, across the board there were familiar phenomena such as a feeling of breaking through. Dirk was currently experiencing this. The first two tiers were considered the beginner stages. They were nothing more than an introduction. People who were tier 1 weren't even considered mages, and those at tier 2, unless they were at somewhere like the academy, also weren't considered true mages. It was only at tier 3 where one would be recognized as having magical talent. This was due to the fact that neither tier 1s nor tier 2s had any significant mana manipulation or storage abilities. But this changed at tier 3, and this change was accompanied by this feeling of breaking through. At tier 3, one would finally be considered a mage because there was this phenomenon. This phenomenon came from the soul. Extensive research had been done by countless other mages, and the conclusion they came to was that there were certain leaps in power the soul would take as one's mana pool grew to certain sizes. As the mana pool grew the soul would grow to accommodate it. Of course, this was only theorized. However, when Dirk was pulled into that ocean of mana, he directly experienced this change. Dirk's soul drifted among the sea of earth, fire, and darkness. Normally, souls would take on the image of the physical body, since mind and body were usually one. But in Dirk's case, his soul took on the image of his past self. His self from earth under his identity as SS008. 
while the body of Dirk resembled his past self, his soul was the real image. Comparing his soul and body, it was like looking at a young and old image of the same person. Dirk's soul, that of his previously adult self, suddenly felt a void be opened up in his chest. His soul was growing to accommodate more mana, like a vessel being expanded. This growth created a deep cavity in his chest. Not long after this cavity appeared, the mana in Dirk's physical body began to flood to it, crossing between dimensions to reach his soul. The mana in the atmosphere also spiraled toward him, like water down a funnel. Dirk watched as the mana heart rapidly disappeared from his physical body, along with it the rune. Seeing this, he didn't panic. This was talked about in his mana heart technique, so he just went with things. As far as he was concerned, everything was going according to plan. However, he did start to panic when his mana heart completely disappeared, and the earth mana around him dwindled. He found that the void was only filled by about a third, meaning he needed much more earth mana. Dirk didn't know what would happen if he couldn't fill the void, but it obviously wasn't as optimal as if it were filled completely. However, just as Dirk was about to pull his consciousness from the mana dimension, he suddenly felt copious amounts of earth mana flood toward him. When the earth mana appeared, it was quickly sucked into his body and injected into the cavity in his soul, like an endlessly greedy beast. Dirk was pleasantly surprised, and he wondered what was happening in the real world. He figured it was his father that had coincidentally stopped by. After all, this was the day to replace the mana crystals. For the sake of his advancement though, he put away all questions. With the earth man around him, Dirk felt like it would be enough to fill the other two-thirds of the void. However, another problem quickly cropped up. After filling about 60% of the void, it suddenly stopped. HM? Dirk was stunned as he found that he couldn't fill the void anymore. He thought that he did something wrong and took a look. When he saw what the problem was though, he frowned even deeper. Along with the earth mana that filled half the void, there was another sliver of mana. This was metal mana from Dirk's specialization. Seeing this, Dirk knew that the rest of the void had to be filled with metal mana. The biggest problem was though that he didn't have any major sources of metal mana besides his mana heart that had been half filled with it. Damn. The book told me to prepare adequate mana resources for the advancement, but I didn't think it would be this strenuous. I figured the tier 5 mana crystals would be enough even though they had already been used up some. Looks like I underestimated just how much my soul wants. Within the mana dimension, Dirk was feeling helpless. The mana heart book had given a rather thorough rundown of what to expect during advancement. It said that enough mana to fill one's mana pool twice over was the best amount of preparation. In this case, the mana heart Dirk had made was his mana pool, so enough mana to fill it twice should be enough. Dirk had assumed that the remaining energy of the tier 5 mana crystal would be enough. And it was enough. But the true amount of mana needed proved to be much larger. The amount of mana indicated by him was at least four times larger than his mana pool. This was due to the depth of his soul and the void opened up by it. Plus, that was just earth mana he still needed metal mana. Now, he was in a bind. He didn't have any metal mana besides the remnants in the atmosphere. But Dirk knew that the void opened up in his soul wouldn't last forever. It would eventually close up, and he could even feel it wanting to shrink. If he wanted to get the most out of this advancement, he needed to fill it before that happened. And he didn't lose hope. Thinking of something, Dirk reached some of his consciousness back into his physical body. One of his eyes opened, and in front of his sitting body, he could see his mother watching him from beside the pedestal and bowl. Meanwhile, Cecilia had been watching Dirk for a while now. Instead of Riker, she decided that she would come and see her child. Only, she stumbled in while he was advancing. At first she wanted to leave and not disturb him. But when she saw that he was voraciously sucking in all the mana, and that even the dense mana environment wasn't enough, she quickly went over to supplement. Things went well after that, and she stayed to watch. However, when she saw her son's eye open and look at her, she was surprised. Cecilia was very powerful, unknown if she was actually weaker than Riker. So when she looked at her son who maintained a connection to the mana dimension, 
she could feel the deep vortex that came from his soul. She could feel that odd state he was maintaining and knew that he was yet to actually complete his advancement. There was still a large void he needed to fill. Metal. Hm. Dirk spoke, and Cecilia perked up with a raised eyebrow. He repeated himself with urgency, looking her in the eye. Metal. Mana. Chapter 68, Tier 3. Metal. Mana. After Dirk almost bellowed his words, Cecilia quickly understood what was going on. He needed metal mana, and fast. However, there was one problem. Metal mana was specialized mana. Technically, it was still of the earth element. But it was also different. Cecilia knew of earth mages who could transform earth mana into metal mana, but they were high-level mages. Dirk wasn't at that level yet, so he could only utilize metal mana in its purest form. So he needed a source of pure metal mana. Unfortunately, when Cecilia looked through the pocket ring on her finger, she couldn't find anything. But she was able to quickly think of something. Without speaking to Dirk, she was suddenly shrouded in darkness, disappearing from the room. As Dirk waited, Cecilia zipped through the academy. She was like a ghost as she flickered through various buildings. Her eyes would momentarily scan several offices and rooms that were owned by high-level mages. When she didn't see what she was looking for though, she disappeared once more. At some point though, she found what she was looking for. It was a large, pudgy-looking man with several fancy rings on his fingers. He was currently fooling around with a potion of who knows what, looking at it with a loving gaze. However, when Cecilia appeared in front of him like a ghost, the man was scared witless. He hugged his potion while pointing a knife he summoned from his pocket ring. W who? Master Shen. It's me. Oh oh. Miss Strider. I thought you were Geral. Seeing the apparition take on human form, the man, Master Shen, sighed in relief. This man was the one who Geralt frequently stole potions from, so seeing a dark mage suddenly appear near him, he naturally had his assumptions. But it was only Miss Strider. As Master Shing had dealt with Riker before, he naturally knew his wife. In fact, to those that knew her, she had a fearsome and even dreadful reputation. Cecilia wasn't in the mood to chat around though. She got to the point, a serious light in her eyes. Quickly. I need a source of pure metal mana. Metal mana? Yes. Anything metal mana can be drawn from. Preferably mana crystals. And I need it now. All right, right. Let me see. As Cecilia looked at him with a dangerous glint in her eyes, Master Shing stumbled around before looking through his pocket rings. He quickly sifted through the thousands of highly valuable items within those rings on his fingers. As an alchemist who worked not only for the academy but for the entire Horizon Empire, he had accumulated extraordinarily vast wealth. It wasn't appropriate to ask what he had, but what he didn't have. And he didn't disappoint. Master Shin quickly spotted a gray marble. He quickly took it out, the marble appearing between his sausage fingers. This is a tier 6 mana crystal from a metal specialized monster. Thank you. I'll be back. Without even asking, Cecilia snatched the marble and disappeared. Seeing her vanish, Master Shing sat back with a few beads of sweat dripping from his forehead. The exchange had taken no more than thirty seconds, yet the cold darkness that came from Cecilia made him shiver. It was as if she had a blade pressed against his neck the entire time. Such an aura, Master Shing couldn't fathom how it was developed. After getting the mana crystal, Cecilia took no more than three seconds to appear back at Dirk's room. However, she didn't put the marble into the bowl. Instead, she directly crushed the marble. From it, metal mana exploded, filling the air with metallic sharpness. Dirk noticed this immediately. Without him even doing anything, the mana flooded into his soul, filling the rest of the void. In fact, he found that because this metal mana was so incredibly dense, it filled the void even more than normal. The metal mana went on to spill into the basic earth mana portion of the void, infecting it with metallic gray. Now, the two halves of the void were brownish gray and dark gray. 
Dirk knew that when mana reached a high enough density, it turned from gas-like to liquid-like. The metal mana he took in was liquid, while the earth mana was gas. Due to that, the liquid metal mana overtook some of the lesser density earth mana, infecting it with its attributes. Even then, there was still a ridiculous amount of metal mana flooding the room. But Dirk couldn't absorb it all. When the void was filled to the brim, no more was allowed in. After that, his soul closed itself off. With that, Dirk's awareness was cast back into his physical body. When that happened, he focused on his man heart. It had originally disappeared, but when the void in his soul was filled, it came back. Dirk saw as the man heart was formed once more above his physical heart. It beat according to his body's rhythm under the influence of the rune he enchanted it with. After a few minutes, it had reformed completely, only this time, it was stronger than ever. It was also half earth mana, half metal mana. Dirk opened his eyes. Surprisingly, he wasn't tired. He felt rejuvenated. Quickly spotting his mother, he smiled. Thank you, mother. Oh, don't you mention it. I'm just glad my baby has advanced. Congratulations. Cecilia clapped and moved over to Dirk, giving him a bear hug. Dirk was happy as he hugged his mother back. So? How'd the advancement go? After enjoying skinship for a bit, Cecilia separated and took a seat in front of her son. Dirk sat back against his own chair. Thanks to the metal mana you gave me, very well. Mm, good. Although, I have a question for you. Did you perhaps become aware of your soul? Hmm. Hearing this question, Dirk was surprised. Deciding there wasn't a need to hide this though, he nodded. Yes. During the advancement, I felt an awareness of my soul. So you really did. Tell me about it. I saw my soul, an ocean of mana around me, and the void in my chest when my advancement occurred. It was weird. Dirk recounted his experience, describing all the weird things he saw and even some of the elemental comprehensions he gained. Although, he didn't mention a word about the dark being he encountered a couple weeks prior. That was something he felt like he should keep to himself for now. That information involved his so-called pure soul trait, after all. Hearing his description, Cecilia was first surprised before becoming stunned. She looked at her son with unconcealed shock, prompting Dirk to stop recounting his experience. I can't believe you were actually able to do that. You actually entered it. You call it the mana dimension? It's called many things, but that's not a bad name for it. Still. Cecilia rubbed her temple as she pondered. Eventually, she just sighed. Well son, you're far more amazing than I thought. That mana dimension, I've only entered it twice, and I'm a tier 6. You, as a tier 3 and teenage boy, were actually able to enter it. If others knew of this, they'd call you a freak. Because of that, you're not to mention a word of this to anybody. Understood? Cecilia looked at him with a stern face. Dirk nodded. He wasn't planning to anyway. Good. Anyway, it looks like your advancement went better than alright. You filled the void in your soul entirely. If you've noticed, the void that opened up in your soul is identical to the mana heart you've formed in your chest. Until now, the mana heart inside you was an auxiliary core that only existed in your material body. Now that you've made your advancement, this core, this mana pool, has been created within your soul. Now, no matter how much mana you expend, you will always regenerate it according to how your mana pool was formed. Even if your mana heart is totally consumed, it will fill itself back up given enough time and mana. Before, if you spent that mana, you would have to actively reaccumulate. Hmm. Listening to her, Dirk nodded in agreement. He had already encountered a situation where his mana heart was wasted. He had to totally reform it, condensing and forming over long periods of time and given lots of effort. Now though, this mana heart was a part of his very soul and would refill by itself. It would never permanently disappear. It was a true and proper mana pool. This was why one wasn't considered a true mage until they reached tier 3. Knowing this, Dirk was a bit proud. 
he was now an official mage at Tier 3 Dash. Compared to anima training, this felt like a much greater and more recognizable achievement. Unconsciously, Dirk found himself smiling like a child. Seeing this, Cecilia felt her heart melt. She went over and scooped Dirk up in another hug. He, such a talented son. You've made your mother very proud. Here, why don't I take you out to celebrate? I think it's time I showed you around the big restaurants in the Empire's capital city. It'll be a date, just you and me. Okay. Hearing the offer, Dirk readily nodded. He had gone into the city very few times. He wouldn't mind exploring it and experiencing its delicacies. With that, mother and son left the academy. Dirk walked with his mother hand in hand as they strolled through the bustling city streets. When night came, Cecilia brought him to a restaurant building that towered into the sky. After getting seated on the top floor of this exorbitantly expensive place, they were served while overlooking the vast city all around them. For Dirk, this was a majestic sight he had never experienced before, even in his previous life. With his mother, he enjoyed every second, feeling all his problems and worries vanish. The day after Dirk made his advancement, he decided to take a break from practicing magic. Instead, he decided to do some physical training. He had neglected his destruction cycles as well, so he went and did one, destroying a large percentage of his blood. Dirk frowned as he felt a burning and stinging pain through his veins. Over time, Dirk went and did his destruction cycles over various areas in order to destroy all his veins and arteries, thus enhancing them all. Each time, his pale skin would show black lines formed from the destroyed blood vessels. On top of that, destroying his blood would leave him weakened. He would feel dizzy for the rest of the day. Over time though, the destruction cycles got progressively easier. This was half because of his genetic enhancement and half due to Dirk getting close to finishing. Once he was done, he would move on to the next section of destruction, destroying his muscles. Dirk wasn't sure if he was looking forward to this. On one hand, it would grant him even greater strength. But the process to get there was definitely fraught with extreme pain and weakness. If Dirk destroyed a muscle, would he still be able to use it? The answer wasn't likely a good one. That was a bridge to cross later though. For now, Dirk just enjoyed the feeling of magical strength. A day later though, Dirk was surprised to see Ava show up at his house. She had finally emerged herself. When the two looked at each other though, both could feel the difference in the strength of the other. In Dirk's mana sense, Ava looked like a deep ocean. And in Ava's mana sense, Dirk looked like a powerful mountain. Since his earth mana far surpassed his other elements, that's all Ava saw. You advanced? You did too, apparently. Congrats. Ava chuckled as she nudged Dirk's shoulder. Both of them were already close to advancing. If Dirk wanted, he could have advanced much earlier, but now they ended up advancing together. It was a double happy occasion. All right, I know celebration is a normal thing after advancing, but I'm wondering when we're going to go on another dungeon dive. We've been holed up for way too long. I say we go and find another king to kill. What do you think? As Ava walked in, she directly laid out her wishes. Hearing this, Dirk couldn't help a smile from surfacing. He had actually been thinking the same thing. Both of them wanted to test this new strength of theirs. I'm as ready as you are. Great. Let's go pick out a job then, shall we? Sure. With two smiles, Dirk and Ava left the house. They quickly arrived at the mission building where they sifted through dozens of job postings on a large wall. The ones they looked for were similar to the difficulty of their previous dive, perhaps a bit harder. The main things they were looking for were suitable kings to kill. They didn't care much for the job itself. Soon, they actually found a good job in the higher difficulty range. The job was to kill a king, and the requested item was its tier 4 water mana crystal. While the high tier of the monster concerned Dirk and Ava, what they were happy about was the fact that this king wasn't strong in body. The previous lizard king they faced had a strong body filled with anima. This monster didn't though. Like people, monsters had both anima and mana, 
and some had both while others had only one. This was a water monster with tier 4 strength and no rank. With Dirk and Ava's dual mana and anima strength, they felt confident in taking such a monster on. After all, the Lizard King they faced had tier 4, magic as well. While it seemed to be lesser than this monster, it also had a strong body, making the battle much more difficult. With these factors, Dirk and Ava accepted the job. That day, they prepared all their gear. With Dirk's pocket ring, he could carry practically all of their items, including armor and weapons so long as they packed light. After some careful organizing, all the items were stuffed inside of the ring besides the stuff on their bodies. This time around, Dirk got rid of his bow. His weapons of choice were his spear, hand axe, and knives. While Dirk could find stronger bows and even learn special skills with the bow, he didn't find it worth it. Dirk liked his ranged weapons, but the bow was just too in the way and specialized. With his melee weapons, Dirk could tackle any situation. As for long-range attacks, he had that covered with his magic. Rock arrows would handle things even better than regular arrows. Thinking a bit, Dirk also decided to go to his mother to get a second-hand axe. With two axes, Dirk would be more confident, and Cecilia didn't reject him. It was amazing, but she had many axes for him to choose from. As Dirk chose his axe, he pondered why his mother would have so many weapons. It seemed to be a hobby of hers, hoarding weapons. With that, Dirk and Ava were ready. The morning of the next day, the two set off. Their destination was a large town, not unlike the town of their previous dungeon dive. This time though, there were three days of travel to this town. Not only that, but Dirk discovered an unsettling addition to this caravan he was riding with. As Dirk and Ava boarded their wagon, they were actually joined by a few other people. There were two men and one woman, all of whom were older than Dirk and Ava by several years. They also weren't people of the academy, looking like free warriors. The three of them piled into Dirk and Ava's wagon. Luckily, the wagon was at least large enough to comfortably fit them all, otherwise Dirk would be very annoyed throughout the ride. Without much weight, the caravan quickly set off. As if they were used to this, the three extras got nice and comfortable. They chatted a bit with familiarity and occasionally glanced at Dirk and Ava, chuckling at the cozy young teens that were with them. Hey, I'm Dean. What are your names? Suddenly, one of the men asked. Dean was a tall man with a charming disposition. Only, he looked a little rough around the edges with his scarred armor and blood-stained sword that lay beside him. I'm Dirk. This is Ava. Dirk answered. Usually he wouldn't feel like talking to other people, but with the recent advancement, he was in a good mood. He wouldn't mind being a bit more social. Well hello, Dirk and Ava. Let me introduce you. The lady right here is named Hannah. How do you do? Upon introduction, Hannah waved sweetly. She seemed like a nice woman in her thirties with short hair and a short height. She was small, and Dirk didn't sense any mana from her, leading him to believe that she was definitely an anima trainer. As for how strong, that was a mystery until he could figure it out himself. And this guy here is Jax. Hey! The man beside Dean, Jax, nodded to Dirk. Dirk nodded back. Jax seemed a bit more reclusive, wrapped in a thick mage's robe. Dirk could also sense a dense earth mana within his body, indicating that he was around tier 4. Of these three, Jax was the only mage while Dean and Hannah were anima trainers. While Dirk couldn't determine the strength of the anima trainers, they shouldn't be any stronger than rank 4. In a fight, Dirk was confident in killing all of them, though it would take significant effort. At the very least, they couldn't kill him without paying a deep price in blood. Dirk quickly thought about this, but soon caught himself and shook such hostile thoughts out of his head. He nodded to them. Nice to meet you all. Hmm. So can I assume you're traveling to Dungeon Dive? Yes. Dirk nodded. The next moment though, he asked a question he had been curious about. What about you three? Dungeon diving? Oh, no. We're the guards for this caravan. Guards? Hearing this, Dirk was surprised. 
Yes. It's not likely, but on this road there's a chance of running into bandits and such. This is because this road runs through a forest, thus giving people unsavory ideas. But it's never usually anybody extremely powerful. Some tier fours and rank fours are enough to deal with trouble. I see. Dirk nodded slowly. Inwardly, he was already frowning. He really didn't want to run into any trouble, but with his previous encounter during his last dungeon dive, he wasn't feeling optimistic. Like that, the caravan set off. Meanwhile, an invisible pair of eyes watched them do so, curling up with sinister intent. Chapter 69 Bandits The caravan was quick to leave through the massive gates of the city, departing towards its destination. After Dirk and Ava went through introductions with their three new acquaintances, the ride was spent in silence. Because Dirk's mood was worsened by the mention of bandits, he surely wasn't going to talk to anybody. Jax also seemed antisocial, so he merely closed his eyes and relaxed against the walls of the wagon. Ava also wasn't that interested in talking and since Dean never spoke up again, nobody decided to be the one to break the silence. Over the next several hours, Dean would occasionally speak with Hannah, the two laughing about various topics. Jax would also laugh with them sometimes. Like that, Dirk and Ava just stuck to themselves, the two sticking right at each other's sides. Whenever Ava wanted to rest, she would lean against Dirk. Such actions had become mostly normal for them, only, their audience seemed to find it cute. This embarrassed Ava a bit, but she felt no need to change what she was doing. It wasn't like Dirk was going to do anything either. This lasted until the end of the first day. When nightfall came around, Dirk thought they were going to continue moving. However, it seemed like the merchant decided otherwise. The caravan stopped when the sun set. All right, set up camp for the night. We continue at sunrise. A man who worked for the merchant announced to everyone. With that, several people piled out of the six wagons in the caravan, taking out bags and beginning to pitch tents. The trio who served as guards also got out to set up camp. Dirk was confused though. He spoke before Dean walked off. Hey, why have we stopped? Normal caravans usually don't, but this one does due to the chances of monster attacks. If we establish a presence, there's less of a chance we'll get attacked by any stray monsters. Also, if we get attacked while moving, there's a chance the goods will be hurt. To circumvent this, merchants like to have everyone set up camp so the attacks will be directed at us first, not the merchandise. It both increases and decreases risk. I see. Dirk sighed at the explanation. He didn't plan on questioning things though. After he and Ava hopped out, they quickly set up their tent. Before going to sleep, everyone ate some food. However, the food that everyone ate almost entirely consisted of dry foods. This was due to the smell and an attempt to keep anything from attracting monsters. Nobody, not even the head merchant, went about cooking food. There were also no fires. With that, everyone eventually went to sleep. By design, all the tents were centered around the three guards so as to ensure a quick response in the event of an attack. But nobody actually expected any attacks, so they all went to sleep with a sound mind. Dirk and Ava cuddled together in their single tent. Them having only one tent earned several knowing grins, but both of them ignored that. Now, within their isolated little tent, Ava unreservedly sapped at Dirk's body heat. The only thing Dirk did was occasionally spit out Ava's hair that drifted between his lips. The campsite was silent and peaceful. Unfortunately, Dirk's fears were fated to come true. After four hours when the dead of night had already set in, there were some light crunches on the ground. At first, this didn't alarm anybody. But when steps became heavy and the sounds of movement approached the campsite, there was one person who snapped. Dirk's eyes shot open. He lifted his head, and his ears became sharp. Sure enough, his suspicions were confirmed. Alert. Human movement detected. Unknowns, 4. Shit. Dirk cursed. Without waking her up, Dirk carefully moved Ava off of him. He then popped to his feet, a knife appearing in his hands. 
In his vision, the AI displayed an estimated location calculation for the sounds of the steps. Dirk's vision seemed to pierce through the tent while the ground showed blotches of light indicating where the sounds were coming from. There were four of these blotches, each indicating four people. And one person was coming right for Dirk's tent. It seemed like these people wanted to figure out who was who before attacking. They were definitely looking for the head merchant. Either way, Dirk heard one of these people approach the front of his tent. He crouched. Because tents in this world had no zippers, there was only a single flap that could be opened without restriction. Dirk's tent flap was slowly pulled open, a man revealing his face. He was completely covered in black, and in his hands was a saber. Right when this man pulled open the flap though, he felt his arm be gripped by an extreme strength. He couldn't even make a noise as he was silently tackled to the floor, a hand covering his mouth. Meanwhile, Dirk used his body to cushion the fall of this person. He held the man on his chest while locking out the arm holding the saber. Only, seeing the weapon, Dirk had his fears confirmed. These people obviously weren't here with gifts to give. Feeling a surge of anger come over him, Dirk put the knife up to the man's throat. As this man's strength was lesser than Dirk's he couldn't even struggle. He froze when the blade was pressed against his neck. Only, getting to this point, Dirk stopped. For some reason, he didn't want to kill the man. When he thought about going straight for the kill, he felt reluctant. He didn't want to do what he did in his past life, simply ending lives because that was seemingly the best or only option. Now, he had a choice. He wanted to make the choice of whether or not to let this man live. Unfortunately, others wouldn't allow him to make that choice. In the corner of Dirk's eye, he could see another bandit approach. This bandit quickly spotted Dirk who held down another bandit, and he took large strides over. Let him go. The other bandit spoke in a low but forceful voice, pointing out with his own sword. Seeing this, Dirk gritted his teeth. Before the other bandit could get close, Dirk's hand moved, and blood went flying. Shing! You! The other bandit was shocked as his friend gurgled on his blood, unable to even cry for help. After that, Dirk jumped to his feet. I'll kill you! Attack! Suddenly, the bandit bellowed, not caring about being silent anymore. With that as the signal, Dirk heard rustling in the nearby forest. At the same time, the caravan crew was alerted. The three guards jumped out of their tents, already armored and armed. Ha! Without suspense, the bandit in front of Dirk rushed forward. Seeing this, Dirk snarled before grabbing his knife by the blade and throwing it. Ack! The knife sailed, piercing into the bandit's chest. Right after, Dirk took a powerful step forward, appearing in front of him. In his hand was now an axe brought out from his ring. Splat! This time, Dirk gave no more chances. His axe directly chopped into the bandit's collarbone, almost severing his head from his body. The bandit fell to his knees as Dirk removed his knife from his body. Then, he fell forward. At this time, everyone had woken up and jumped out of their tents. Ava included. Upon looking outside, she saw Dirk standing there with two bodies next to him. She was shocked as fear welled up within her. She quickly realized what was happening. Put on your armor and wait here. Dirk spoke to her before dropping her armor and weapon on the floor. Without waiting for her response, he then shot off toward another bandit. In only a few seconds, Ava saw him swiftly kill another with a knife to the throat. It wasn't long before he shot into the forest while the three guards handled those bandits within the campsite. Ava gritted her teeth before grabbing her armor and quickly putting it on. Then, with her axe, she waited next to the tent, not going out to fight. As she promised before, she would let Dirk handle this stuff. This was the time to hold true to that, only, she hated that it was happening again. With loud screams and gory sounds, the night was rapidly filled with bloodshed. However, the three guards didn't disappoint. They quickly dispatched all enemies. While one of the merchant's people was injured, they at least prevented anyone from losing their lives. These bandits weren't that strong. All enemies killed. Good. Is everyone alright? 
gather up here. The guards shouted, and everyone huddled in the center of the campsite. Ava also came walking over as lights were lit up around the place. She looked both sad and angry as she hugged her axe. Dean counted everyone before spotting Ava. When he didn't see Dirk though, he frowned. Ava, where's Dirk? I. I'm right here. Before Ava responded, there was a voice from the darkness. Dean looked over and saw Dirk. At first he sighed in relief. But when Dirk's figure was lit up, he was shocked. Dirk was currently covered with large streaks and blotches of blood. They dyed his clothes and even his face red. In his hand was an axe and knife that both dripped blood as well. I killed three enemies in the forest. One was an archer. Oh. Dean couldn't even respond as he looked at Dirk's horrifying figure. Despite how scary Dirk looked though, Ava quickly walked over to him. In her hands was a handkerchief that she dampened with water. She didn't say anything as she wiped his face and neck of blood. Are you hurt? No. Good. Let me clean your clothes tonight before we go back to sleep. Give me your shirt. All right. Dirk didn't refuse as he took off his blood-soaked shirt. As Ava took it, Dean spoke up. Dirk? Yes? Thank you. Hmm. Dirk nodded simply before walking away with Ava. Dean could only sigh before turning back to the group, sending them back to their tents. While everyone else went back to sleep, Ava used her water magic to wash Dirk's bloodied clothes. Dirk also washed up a bit and changed, and when Ava laid out the clothes to dry, both of them climbed back into their tent. Only after Ava checked his body for wounds though did they go to sleep. As this wasn't the first time something like this had happened, Ava wasn't as shocked but she still hated watching Dirk go out and kill people. She wanted to go out and fight with him, but as Dirk had iterated before, she shouldn't deal with such things. She wanted to ignore this, but when she thought about actually killing a person, she felt weak. In the end, she knew she wasn't ready, and so she left it to Dirk. She felt like she wasn't sticking to her promise though, instead being a coward. It made her want to cry, but for Dirk, she held back. Like that, the rest of the night passed smoothly. This time though, the guards took shifts to keep watch. On this trip, they would no longer be careless. The next day, everyone woke up bright and early. None of them were in a good mood though. They all looked groggy as if they hadn't gotten any sleep. There was definitely some truth to that assumption. Without eating, everyone quickly packed and boarded the wagons. As the sun peeked over the horizon, the caravan was already moving through the forest road. Now, Dirk and Ava were fully geared even as they rode in the wagon. And unlike the first day, none of the three guards were merely chuckling at Dirk and Ava. They were silent, only occasionally glancing at Dirk and remembering his nightmarish appearance from the night before. Despite everyone's downtrodden and pessimistic moods though, the day went by uneventfully. When nightfall came, another campsite was made. With the assurance of the guards who kept watch, everyone got decent sleep. And sure enough, there weren't any more attacks. With that, the third day came around. By sundown, they would reach the town. Everyone thought that this home stretch would be uneventful as well. Unfortunately, fate proved otherwise. Around noon, when the sun was high in the sky, Dirk was glancing out at the forests around the wagon. When bored, he would numb his mind by watching the scenery go by. However, as he did so, his AI flashed and highlighted certain areas of the forest. Dirk's vision suddenly sharpened as the AI processed some oddities. Then, there was suddenly a red flash. A figure was highlighted. It was a person who popped out from behind a tree. He held a bow and was pulling back an arrow. The target was Dirk's wagon, perhaps even him. Get down. Turning, Dirk suddenly grabbed Ava next to him and dipped to the floor of the wagon, his body on top of hers. The next second, an arrow sailed right over where their bodies were, sticking into one of the walls. Unfortunately, this wasn't an ordinary arrow. A couple seconds after it landed, a fire blazed. Boom! A small explosion blew apart the wall of the wagon. 
Dirk felt a burst of fire wash over him for a bit before dissipating. Thankfully, it wasn't a high-level fire, and his body and armor could easily handle it. As for Ava underneath him, she was safe. Ah. However, Dirk and Ava weren't the only ones in the wagon. When the fire blazed, it washed over the three guards. Two of them were only anima trainers, and Jax was the only one who could summon countermeasures with his earth magic in time. Dean and Hannah were burned, their hair and face being scorched. As the fire only lasted a second though, it was nothing serious. After recovering, Dean shook off the pain and jumped out of the wagon that already stopped. He looked at the forest where several figures appeared. Jax! I got it! Dean shouted, and Jax came running. A magic circle appeared on his hands, and a thick rock wall was quickly created. After that, Dean pulled a bow out of his pocket ring, taking aim at one of the figures that was charging the caravan. Fling! An arrow was loosed. It flew at unnatural speeds before sticking one of the bandits. The bandit fell to the floor as his lung was pierced by the arrow. Only, there were several others to take his place. They charged with roars and screamed. The entire caravan was shocked as eighteen bandits came charging at them. Even Dean was cursing. What is this hellish luck? All right, looks like we're earning our pay today. Fight. Got it. Jax and Hannah nodded before moving into action. Jax cast magic from behind the wall, razor-sharp rock arrows appearing above his head. Hannah also summoned a shield from her ring, charging forward with a sword in hand. She quickly clashed with two bandits, cutting one down in a few moves. However, there were too many bandits. They all charged the caravan, threatening to kill the other workers and destroy the wagons. Seeing this, Dirk sighed. He looked at Ava, who looked back at him as if pleading with him not to go. Stay here. I'll be back. Saying that, Dirk jumped out of the wagon. He then disappeared amidst the chaos. Shing! A bandit moved between the wagons, searching for people to kill. Suddenly though, a knife came from nowhere and sliced his neck open. Blood sprayed as the body fell. No! We'll give you money, just leave us be. Three other bandits broke open the door of one of the wagons containing workers. The workers pleaded, but to their cries, the bandits merely raised their weapons with evil cackles. Before they could slice down though, they felt sharp burning in their backs. Ag! One of the bandits screamed as his leg was chopped in half. Another directly collapsed to the ground as an axe buried itself in his back. The last one barely turned around before a knife was plunged into his chest, directly piercing his lung. The workers inside the wagon were horrified to stillness as the three bodies collapsed. They then saw Dirk who ended the death cries of the man who had his leg chopped off. Dirk didn't spare them a glance as he dashed off in another direction. The area was filled with screams as people were mercilessly killed. Some more bandits emerged from the forest, including a leader who wielded surprising strength. This leader along with many of his minions were taken care of by the three guards though. Hannah killed five with her sword and shield while Jax killed six with his rock arrows. As for Dean, he killed four along with the leader. This totaled fifteen bandits that died at their hands in front of the wagons. But there were many that slipped by. After taking care of the bandits at front, the three rushed to the other wagons to kill any that snuck past. But surprisingly, they found none. At least, none that were alive. As they ran around, they found nothing but bodies. Most were killed cleanly, but some were obviously ended brutally. Counting, there were eleven bandit bodies amidst the wagons. Where's Dirk? Thinking, Dean asked around. There was only one person who could do this, and that was Dirk who had shown his ability for killing. He looked around, even asking Ava. But nobody had an answer. Meanwhile, Dirk was actually in the forest. After killing everyone and making sure the battle was over, he went and grabbed a bandit who he kept alive. Dragging this bandit into the forest on the opposite side of the caravan, Dirk was prepared to do a little interrogation. He looked at the bandit who shivered under his apathetic gaze, knife in hand. 
Despite the blank gaze though, his heart was bristling with rage. Chapter 70, Hostel Announcement If you're seeing this, that means the scheduled release succeeded. I'm currently on a trip and had to schedule the chapter release early. Enjoy the automatically released chapter. Dirk overlooked the bandit he had taken hostage. After taking his mask and hood off, this bandit looked to be a normal boy in his early twenties. But Dirk felt no sympathy seeing this young face. No matter who it was, in this moment right now, Dirk was as cold as cold gets. He bent down to the same level as the bandit who laid against a tree. This bandit had already been wounded, stabbed through the leg and unable to even walk. He groaned in pain, but in the presence of this monstrous kid who slaughtered half his bandit group, he was stifled with fear. Who sent you? Dirk finally asked. Hearing him, the bandit shivered a bit. Our, our leader. No, I know your leader launched the attack. I want to know, who sent your leader? Think very carefully about anybody new you saw in recent days. Aye aye. The bandit was panic-stricken as Dirk raised his knife. His mind worked exceptionally quick. I think there was a man. We had never seen him before last night. And? And, he? The bandit stumbled in his words as Dirk's knife traced the wound on his leg. A single twitch, and who knew what Dirk would do to him? However, before the bandit could respond, Dirk suddenly felt a chill crawl up his back. Out of nowhere, he threw his body backward. Just as he moved, an arrow of darkness sailed over. It instantly pierced the bandit's chest, impaling his heart. The bandit froze, and then, black flames lit up around his body. Ag! The bandit boy bellowed miserably, bearing untold pain. Then, his body exploded. Dirk jumped backward once more, avoiding the dark flames that spread out. Who is it? With an exploding rage, Dirk flipped around. His eyes rapidly scanned the entire forest around him. Then, in the corner of his eye, he saw a small distortion. Not even Dirk's AI picked this up before he did. That's because this distortion came from dark mana. Dirk could see the slightest fluctuation in the mana right behind a tree. This distortion existed for a mere moment before disappearing. Dirk narrowed his eyes at that. He didn't even care about evidence. He knew that was the person who was making trouble for him. Dirk wanted to chase, but he couldn't pick up on even the slightest trail. This person was gone, vanished with the wind. If this person could use dark mana, they could use void walking, and Dirk couldn't keep up with that. This person was a much higher tier than him. Damn. His fists trembled. Looking down at the tree near him, he saw that the bandit was now no more. Not even blood remained. With that, Dirk had no need to remain here. Returning to his seemingly calm self, he let out a long breath before walking back to the caravan. Dirk? When he emerged from the forest, Ava was first to spot Dirk. She ran over. After this battle, despite having killed more, he didn't have but a few blood splatters on his armor. Still, Ava was downcast at the whole situation. She stopped in front of Dirk who radiated the slight aura of deep rage. A are you okay? Yes. Dirk nodded as he looked at Ava. Suddenly, he took a step toward her and used an arm to pull her into a hug. With that, he felt himself calm down. The two stayed like that for a while until Dean came walking over. Oh good, you're safe. Thank you Dirk. Thank me? Hearing Dean, Dirk separated from Ava and looked at him. Despite having calmed down, he was not in anything like a good mood. He snapped at Dean. Instead of thanking me, I think you should get better at your job. E excuse me? I'm sorry, did I not make myself clear? Dirk looked at Dean with narrow eyes. Dean suddenly felt a surge of anger overcome him, and Ava was also shocked by Dirk's hostile attitude. Watch your mouth, little boy. Watch mine. From behind Dean, Hannah suddenly came over with a glare. She had heard the two, and being insulted like that wasn't pleasing. Yes, watch your mouth. There's only so much three people can do against a small army. Please. 
I killed eleven by myself. How about next time, you use that shield of yours to actually block people? Hey! Dirk! As Hannah shouted in anger, Ava suddenly stepped in front of Dirk. Dirk, come on. Let's just go rest. There's only a little longer to go until we reach the town. As Ava took his hand and pleaded, Dirk felt his anger subside a bit. He sighed and nodded. With a small smile, Ava took his hand and led him back to their destroyed wagon. Seeing that, Dean also shook his head, deciding not to escalate things. Only, Hannah was still bristling with anger. Humph, go on back to your little safe place. You know, maybe if your little girlfriend didn't hide away like a coward the whole time, there wouldn't have been so many people who got past U.S. Hannah. After she spit out her words, Dean snapped and shouted back at Hannah. At the same time, he saw Dirk stop walking, and a bad feeling rose up within him. After hearing Hannah's venomous words, Ava was the first to freeze up. This struck right at her insecurity. Dirk knew this of course. He was the one who told Ava to let him handle these things. And now, Hannah was stabbing right at that sore spot. Feeling Ava's trembling body, Dirk felt something in him snap. He let go of Ava's hand, patting her head. Let me handle these things. He spoke with a surprisingly calm voice. Only, this caused Ava to shake a bit more. She remained quiet, not stopping him as he turned back toward Hannah and Dean. Dirk, I'm sorry about Hannah. Let's end things here. Damn. Dean spoke in an attempt to mediate. Only, when Dirk didn't listen, he gritted his teeth. Things had gotten out of hand, and he didn't know how powerful Dirk was. Dean stepped forward, blocking Hannah. Dirk stopped right in front of Dean, raising his head and looking right into his eyes. Get out of my way. Dirk spoke simply. Dean shook his head though. She's part of my team. You can't hurt her. Look, let's stop here. I'll pay you for your help. Dean raised his hand, about to pat Dirk's shoulder. However, Dirk's hand shot up, grabbing his wrist. Dean was shocked by his grip strength. If you won't let me, then I'll hurt you as well. Ha! Huh. Realizing what was about to happen, Dean cursed and activated his muscles. Dirk's body also strengthened at that moment, and Dean was shocked to feel his body be jerked forward by Dirk's strength. Dirk's body turned, Dean's arm being thrown over his shoulder. With perfect, violent form, Dean was raised into the air and slammed into the ground. Boom! Ack! Dean felt his body shake as he was whipped into the floor. Then, he felt Dirk's grip disappear. When he jumped to his feet, he saw him dashing to Hannah. Meanwhile, Hannah was shocked by Dirk's sudden attack. She backed away as her body unconsciously tightened up. Then, she gritted her teeth and threw out a punch toward his oncoming body. There was no avoiding a fight. When she threw that punch though, Dirk's body twisted. He dodged the arm and threw up his knee, driving it right into her stomach. Pa! Hannah felt weakness overcome her as that knee knocked all the wind out of her, shaking her organs. She kneeled to the floor, but the anima in her body along with her many years of experience still gave her some capacity to fight. When Dirk's leg came swinging around, she was barely able to raise her arms and defend. Bang! His leg slammed into her arms and torso. Hannah's body was sent flying, tumbling along the ground. At that moment, Dirk heard the wind move behind him. He ducked. Whoosh! A leg came sailing over his head. It was Dean's. After dodging, Dirk turned and deflected a punch. After that though, he had to block and defend against a barrage of punches from Dean. Each one was powerful, wielding strength just a bit greater than Dirk's. He was also fast, and Dirk's reaction times were tested. Ha! Ah. Dean shouted as he drove a fist into Dirk's side. Dirk was silent though as he took the beating. Dirk made no sounds, as if he didn't feel pain at all. He just watched Dean's body with ruthless acuity. Over time, Dean dished out more and more beatings. Dirk took it all and threw out his own counters. Each of his counters landed on Dean's body, sending shockwaves through the point of impact. 
Dean's speed and strength were high, but his defensive ability wasn't up to PAR. Thus, Dirk's hits hurt him greatly. Dean moved quicker and quicker, minimizing the chances for Dirk to attack. However, that couldn't last forever. With Dean moving so fast and with so much strength, he was bound to run out of stamina first. In truth, this was what Dirk was working toward. Each section of Dirk's anima resonance destruction technique gave a perk when trained. Dirk's skin destruction gave him increased anima absorption capabilities. Now, Dirk's blood destruction section that was almost finished gave him increased stamina and regenerative abilities. That combined with the genetic enchantment he went through gave him seemingly endless stamina. While Dirk wasn't rank 4 like Dean, he wasn't far from it. He was able to bridge the gap with his stamina, placing them on the same level. He took the beatings to outlast Dean, draining his stamina faster. Over time, Dean came to understand this. He was shocked by Dirk's endurance, and so he sought to end the fight quicker. His hits became a level harder. When that happened though, Dirk started to retaliate. Dirk's strength burst forth. In exchange for greater wounds, Dirk threw out punches and kicks that rattled Dean's body. Not only that, but all his hits landed on either vital spots or pressure points. They all sent waves of weakness through Dean's body. Hannah. Right as he was feeling beat though, Dean suddenly called out. It was a voice filled with rage, and one would think he was cursing the woman. But Hannah knew that he was both cursing and calling for her. She ran over from the sidelines, joining the fight. With that addition, Dirk was placed under greater pressure. But he didn't panic. He took the extra beatings while moving between the two enemies. Hannah took some of the pressure off Dean, but now she had to withstand Dirk's ruthless attacks as well. By now, their fight had already attracted the gazes of the merchant's workers. None of them stepped forward though. They wouldn't dare take even a single hit these people threw out. Even one of those punches or kicks would end their life. Dean and Hannah fought Dirk for a few minutes. Dirk became increasingly wounded, but their stamina also dwindled. Dirk's attacks kept raining down on them with the same strength as when he started, and with their lesser energy levels, they were beaten down. When the two kept being stubborn though and refused to go down, Dirk felt his anger erupt once more. Enough! Ack! Suddenly, Dirk shot a fist right at Dean's liver. His body shook before blood streamed from his mouth and nose. As Dean faltered, he threw a kick at his knee, immediately breaking it. And when Dean fell to his knees, Dirk drove his knee into his jaw, knocking him out. The chain attacks were so smooth it seemed like he had done it a million times before. Dirk's bloodied face then turned to Hannah, grabbing the fist she shot toward him from behind. Hannah was horrified as Dirk not only crushed her hand with his grip strength, but shot his palm right toward her extended elbow. Crack! Ah! With a nasty sound, Dirk broke her arm. The elbow bent the wrong way, and Hannah fell to the floor. Dirk stood between his two fallen enemies, his breathing heavy but steady. His face was bruised while his body was even worse, but this much wasn't enough to take him down. While Dean was taking a nap on the floor, Dirk took a step toward the panicking Hannah. He grabbed her by the throat, stopping her screams and shoving her against one of the nearby wagons. Dirk looked into her eyes, speaking between breaths. You wanna say those things again? I know you're in a lot of pain right now. Say what you did again. Maybe I'll end your misery. Dirk spoke ominously as he brought up his other hand. Around his fingers were claws of darkness. When Dirk traced Hannah's arm with those claws, she felt a horrible corrosive power sear her skin. At that moment though, Dirk heard labored footsteps walk over. He turned and saw a fat little man. Stop! Please! Sir Dirk, I apologize for whatever may have happened. Let them live, and I'll be sure to pay your handsomely for your service. Dirk was silent as he listened to this man. This fat man was the head merchant, the owner of the caravan. He was dressed in luxurious clothes that made him stand out. It was because of this that he had been spotted by the bandits and wounded. Dirk was the one who saved him since the three guards were busy handling the front. Dirk didn't immediately respond. 
Instead, he turned his head to where Ava was. Near her, he saw Jax. He had been wondering where this Jax was and why he didn't join the fight. He narrowed his eyes at him. Are you going to interfere? I'm not exactly with those two. I'm a direct guard under the merchant. That being said, I will have to step in if you decide to kill them. Such things aren't good for anybody here. Hearing Jax's explanation, Dirk went quiet. If he killed these people, then no matter what, the merchant's reputation would drop a bit. Plus, Hannah and Dean were still guards. Their value was high. And at the end of the day, this whole situation could be said to be caused by Dirk. They got caught up in his bad luck. It was why he did his best to defend the caravan. It was also why he had decided to drop his conflict with Dean and Hannah. Only, Hannah had taken it one step too far. Dirk turned and looked at Hannah. By now, all eyes were on him. Technically, he was the strongest one here. He hadn't even used his magic. Hannah and Dean's lives were in his hands. Dirk sent one last spine-chilling glare at Hannah before throwing her. Thud. Cough. After landing on the floor, Hannah coughed and heaved for breath. Jax and the merchant sighed in relief. Right after, some of the workers carried Dean and Hannah off, putting them in another wagon. Dirk walked back over to the wagon he and Ava rode in. While it had a giant hole in it now, it still worked. The two climbed in alone, Dirk not sparing another glance to anyone around him. Let's set off. It's time to get out of this damned forest. With a loud announcement, the merchant and his workers moved the caravan once more. All the wagons started moving at their fastest speed. Nobody wanted to remain in this forest any longer. As they moved, Dirk and Ava were quiet inside their wagon. Ava had taken off Dirk's armor and was cleaning the blood from his body and face. There were bruises that bled and his lip was split, causing blood to pool in his mouth that he spit into a cloth. Blood also came out with his coughs. I lost my temper. Sorry. As Ava wiped his neck of blood, Dirk suddenly spoke. Ava shook her head. No. That, woman. She just couldn't drop it. You kept anyone from dying and had to kill eleven people to do so. They should be grateful. They were. If I hadn't snapped at them, then we wouldn't have fought. Ava was quiet. Indeed, it was Dirk's hostility that started the fight. Only, Ava didn't believe that Dirk was in the wrong. She hated that he had to harm even one person. To rely on him to kill eleven people was ridiculous. He was still only a teenager. You were right though. Those sorry excuses for guards need to get better at their jobs. If they were actually able to defend, then you wouldn't have had to go out there. Maybe. Dirk sighed. He felt helpless. Someone was trying to hurt him, and he couldn't even see this person, let alone kill them. Originally this ride should have gone perfectly fine. But they had actually been attacked twice. Dirk didn't have much of a choice but to fight. If he didn't, then lives would have been taken. At the very least, he wouldn't allow that, regardless of his reluctance to kill. Still, Dirk had lost control of his anger. At this point though, he wasn't sure if he cared. For the first time, he was allowed to express himself. He felt anger at the incompetence of these guards, and he said something about it. Originally, he held himself back. Just because he felt angry didn't mean he had to act on it. The situation was what it was. It had already passed, and he would never see these people again once they were at the town. He had a little verbal confrontation to express his displeasure. And with Ava's beckoning, he dropped it. But then, Hannah had touched the bottom line that he didn't even know was there. And for once, he was allowed to do something about it. So he did. He made her pay with blood and pain. Like that, he established his bottom line and punished someone for crossing it. While Dirk knew things could have gone better, and that he wasn't in the right, he felt tired of playing nice. His emotions were growing, all these events pushing his patience and igniting his anger. He didn't care that only three people couldn't handle a small army. He didn't care that he was being targeted and attacked. 
his hand was being forced, and he was pissed off. This little fight was just him being an emotional boy. Dirk wondered if this was how normal people acted, instead of being emotionless machines. He actually didn't mind it. Chapter 71 Self-Conscious The rest of the ride went smoothly. Nobody wished to approach Dirk, so he and Ava were left alone inside their wagon. Like that, the two rested with each other as they pulled up to the town. Upon arrival, Dirk and Ava jumped out of the wagon. The sun was already setting and night would be coming soon, so the air was taking on a comfortable chill. Right after they stretched their stiff limbs, they saw the merchant hobble over to them. Sir Dirk, I just want to thank you. I don't think anybody could have guessed that we would be attacked twice on this trip. Still, you saved the lives of me and my people. Take this. Saying that, the merchant dropped a sack into Dirk's hands. It was filled with coins. That holds the money you paid for this trip along with a gift from me, as thanks for everything you've done. Without you, I fear that possibly everyone might have lost their lives or have been taken hostage. Then I would really be ruined. So once again, thank you. With that, the merchant bid goodbye. Dirk didn't say a word throughout, something that half signified his acceptance. He could only sigh as he and Ava finally walked into the town. As they left, they caught a glimpse of the three guards. Dirk only looked at them once though before continuing on. He didn't need the sight of those people to further ruin his mood. After taking a look around them, Dirk and Ava were surprised by how wealthy this town seemed to be. The buildings were made of stone and there were a few that rose to almost 100 meters in height. If it covered a larger area, then it would be considered a small city. Seeing the myriads of people walking through the streets, Dirk and Ava felt their spirits lifted a bit. The ride to this town had been spent with sour moods due to the attacks, so they only wanted to have a little peace. Dirk felt disappointed thinking about this. Both of them had left with springy and happy smiles since they had just advanced. They were planning on coming to this town and rushing to the king's hall, killing the king before returning victorious. Now, it wouldn't be the glorious adventure they thought it would be. Bad luck and anger had ruined it for everyone. But time healed all wounds. After spending a while taking a stroll together, Dirk and Ava didn't feel so bad. In this place where nobody knew them, they could act and feel however they wanted. While they walked, Dirk opened up the bag the merchant gave him. After looking inside and counting the coins, he was surprised to see 500 gold inside. This was a bit under double the reward for the mission they were doing. It seemed Dirk had frightened the merchant more than he thought. This put Dirk in an even happier mood. If he could make that much money every trip, he wouldn't mind doing it a few times. He really gave a lot, huh? Ava saw the 500 gold and was also surprised. If they wanted, they could return to the academy and it would have made for a worthwhile trip. Only, they didn't come here for money, but practice. They had no intention of returning. Dirk closed the bag and put it into his pocket ring. I guess the lives of two guards are worth 500 gold. You mean the lives of the merchant along with his workers and then guards? Considering that you saved and spared the lives of the entire caravan, 500 isn't actually that much. Thinking this, Ava frowned a little. Dirk had killed around 16 people this trip, a number that would have been 18 should Hannah and Dean have really gotten on his bad side. He also saved the entire caravan. Depending on the value of the merchandise being moved, 500 gold truly wasn't a lot. The merchant could have lost thousands. Hearing Ava, Dirk smirked a bit. She was still angry about everything that happened and would likely hold a grudge for a long while. Dirk didn't push the topic though. As only he knew, everything likely happened due to his presence. He couldn't in right mind demand excessive compensation for something he indirectly caused. For him, 500 gold was a good number. Whatever. Let's head into the Dungeon Association and get a map. Tomorrow we'll head in. All right. Are you sure you don't want to rest a day? Your body isn't exactly in its best condition. Ava looked at Dirk worriedly. His face still had several bruises on it along with a split lip. 
his body was even worse, and Ava had spotted several black bruises on his torso. The beating he took wasn't light since it came from too low rank for anima trainers. The only reason he was still standing was because of his unrelenting endurance. Hearing her, Dirk initially wanted to refuse. But when he thought about relaxing and spending some peaceful time with Ava, he changed his mind. It wasn't like they were rushing or anything. They had plenty of time. Why force himself to his limit if there was no need? All right. Let's rest tomorrow. We have all this money. Maybe we can go to a restaurant. I like that idea. Ava smiled at the suggestion. Dirk smiled at her smile, and like that, the two walked to the Dungeon Association. There, they bought a map and some information telling them about the dungeon monsters and king. Dirk scanned it all before pocketing it. So, what restaurant? As they walked out of the association building and onto the darkening streets of the town, Ava nudged Dirk's shoulder while asking. He confidently spoke. The biggest one of course. There's no way food would cost more than 500 gold at even the biggest place here. You'll only see stuff like that in the capital. Dirk mumbled as he thought about his celebratory date with his mother. The restaurant they went to had been so amazingly expensive that Dirk gawked when his mother whipped out three crystal coins at the end of their meal. That was 3,000 gold coins just for their food. While the food was indeed heavenly, Dirk was disgusted at such ridiculous prices. He was even further shocked when his mother told him about food that cost dozens, hundreds, and even thousands of crystal coins. While those foods were created from materials harvested from tier 6 and 7 monsters, it was still crazy that such food existed. Dirk couldn't fathom such things at his level. Shrugging, Dirk and Ava walked toward the biggest buildings in the town. One of them was the Dungeon Association, but the other was actually a restaurant. It was here that Dirk and Ava walked. Of course, Ava couldn't resist linking arms with Dirk as they walked in. Just two for tonight? Arriving at the door, a nice hostess greeted the two with a smile. Ava nodded happily. Yes, just us two. Can we go to the top floor? That depends. Do you have sufficient capital? How does 500 gold sound? Dirk spoke as he raised the bag containing exactly 500 gold. The hostess nodded with a smile. Very well. Take this card and head to the top. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Taking the card, Ava pulled Dirk in with a bright smile. It wasn't very often she got to feel like a VIP customer, so she was relishing in the feeling. Besides, it wasn't like her and Dirk's families weren't already filthy rich. Several thousand gold was nothing much to them, so they didn't mind spending a measly 500 gold that they got from some merchant. That was if they spent it all anyway. With that, the two ascended straight to the top of the building. There, they were led to a private booth on the wall of the room that overlooked the entire town. For a few miles around, they could see soft lights glowing in the nightly darkness among the hundreds of town buildings. Ava was fascinated by the sight. It wasn't nearly as glorious as the capital city, but this little town held its own charm. After a while, the two placed orders with a waiter that elegantly catered to them, spending 170 gold in one go. After that, it wasn't long before plates of food were brought out. Side by side, the two dug in. They tasted all the different flavors of each dish, even feeding the other bites of their own dish. Occasionally they giggled like children, earning stares and glances from the rest of the people in the room. The two just focused on each other though, not bothering to put up an act for random strangers. Like this, they spent almost two hours at their table. By the end, after their plates had been totally cleaned, they gazed out at the dark landscape partially lit by the two moons in the sky. Mmm. -hmm. I'm tired. As Ava leaned on Dirk's body, she softly spoke while resisting the call to sleep. Let's go then. I think the other large building is a hotel. Okay. The two stood, Dirk partially supporting Ava's drowsy self. They walked out of the restaurant and into another tall stone building with a big sign on it. It was here that Dirk paid 80 gold for a single room on the top floor, earning him a wink from the hotel manager. 
he rolled his eyes as he basically carried Ava up the many stairs. Upon walking into their room, Ava let herself fall onto the large bed. Ah, this is actually really comfortable. And clean. I would hope so. Dirk spoke as he sat down. The sheets were fresh and mattress thick. The only bed he would be more comfortable in was the bed inside his own home. Come here. Suddenly, Ava grabbed Dirk's arm and pulled him into the bed. She flicked up the sheets, covering both of them. She then curled against his body under the cold covers in an attempt to keep warm. Dirk didn't resist, of course. As Ava got more and more brazen, he went along with it. After she cuddled against him, he enjoyed her fingers that ran through his hair. Definitely not one of the best days we've ever had. Heh, <laughs> far from it. Dirk chuckled at Ava's soft evaluation. First they were attacked by bandits, then Dirk had to take the beatings of two rank fours. While they had a nice night out at a fancy restaurant later at night, it wasn't able to totally erase the gloominess of the day's events. While Dirk's soul was already that of an adult, it seemed both of them had aged years over this single ride to town. Especially Ava. Dirk regretted how fast she was being forced to grow up. Unfortunately, in this world of magical power and monsters, death and destruction were a much more prevalent way of life. There was no escaping it, especially not for people like Ava who were walking the path of a mage and warrior. If anything, they were diving in head first, and Ava was only getting a taste of what life would be like from now on. Still, with Dirk's adaptation to this new life and Ava's growth amidst this chaotic world, they were both becoming stronger people. With these emotional downs, they were able to enjoy the happy ups even more. Ava turned her head up and looked at Dirk's face. With her innate mental powers, she could sense tranquility from him with only some small ripples. It seemed he had calmed greatly despite the turbulence during the attacks. Thank you. For what? He, for saving me from the scary bad guys. Ava grinned as she hugged Dirk's body. After slipping her fingers in between his, she looked at his cheek. With a beating heart, she seemed to make a decision before moving closer. Then, Dirk felt a soft sensation on his cheek. After letting it pass, he turned his head, looking at Ava's rosy face. They laid there with their faces only an inch away from the other. Neither said anything, only feeling the warm shallow breaths of the other. Then, slowly, Ava inched closer. Dirk felt himself be frozen by an invisible force, all his instincts that kept him calm in sudden and unexpected situations vanishing. She pushed forward. Their lips touched, sending shivers down both of their bodies. Ava's initially tight grip on Dirk's hand loosened as she felt herself melt a little. Dirk's body also relaxed. At that moment, he felt incredibly vulnerable. Usually he would push away any form of vulnerability, but right now, he couldn't help but revel in it. The conflict between wanting to be guarded and wanting to be open raged in his mind, but with Ava's touch, the latter side won. After what felt like an eternity, the two separated just a little. Dirk stared at her, unsure of what to do. And she looked back, waiting, expecting more. But he didn't go for more. He knew he couldn't. Instead, he let out a long breath and dipped his head. He felt bad as Ava's breathing became a bit light, but neither of them spoke. Instead, Dirk just ignored everything else and went to sleep, trying to get his mind off his conflict. Mm. As the sun blessed the world with its vital light once more, Dirk's body automatically woke him up. He opened his eyes before squinting under the bright sunlight that streamed through the windows in his room. As he lay there, his brain quickly processed the events of the night before. Remembering everything, he suddenly frowned. Oh God! He pinched his nose as a long breath escaped his mouth. Looking down at Ava's content face on his chest, he felt shameful and conflicted. She didn't know the first thing about his true self, and he felt like he was lying to this innocent soul. It was why he didn't go further. He closed his eyes. Well, at least my self-restraint is still there. Mmm. -hmm. At that moment, Dirk felt Ava shift as she let out a small moan. His mouth closed as her body moved against his. Through their loose and thin clothes, 
he could feel every detail, making him feel even more shameful. He adjusted a bit, moving her off his body and to his side. After Ava stretched out and popped a few joints, she sighed and opened her eyes. The two stared at each other for a while before she eventually spoke. So what should we do today? Honestly, maybe we should head into the dungeon. Dirk spoke his honest thoughts after thinking for a second. He was afraid that if they got too much alone and quiet time, she might want to try again. The dungeon was the perfect distraction from her developing feelings. Really? How are your wounds? Ava asked as she looked at his face. When she actually concentrated on it, she was surprised. All the bruises were gone, and even the split lip was now only a thin red cut. After lifting his shirt and looking at his chest and abdomen, she was even more shocked. The day before, he was filled with black and purple bruises, some of which even bled. Now, his skin was almost perfectly clear, his toned body being shown off in full glory. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. I think my destruction cycles are paying off. Well, if you're really all right. Ava mumbled unsurely as she lowered his shirt. This rate of healing seemed a bit too fast. Of course, she didn't know about Dirk's nanites. With those on top of his twice-enhanced blood and enhanced skin, healing from bruises was something that would indeed happen within the day. And Dirk really did feel almost perfectly fine. There were only a few internal wounds that he had yet to heal from, but he wouldn't tell Ava that. We should go then. Mm, all right. But, we don't have to go right this second. I think we do. Get up. Ack! Dirk pinched her side as she got a bit too comfy, causing her to jerk away in response. If Dirk had come to know one interesting detail about her, it was that she absolutely hated being tickled. So after being sobered, both of them prepared to leave. Dirk could have swore that she sighed in disappointment, but he could only ignore it. I hate myself and everyone in this town. An hour later, Dirk cursed himself as he and Ava walked down a town street. Both of them were geared up for the dungeon, and their faces were in stark contrast to the other. As they walked, Ava stuck to Dirk like glue, smiling radiantly as who knew what thoughts fluttered through her pink mind. It didn't seem like his subtle rejection had even happened. On the contrary, Dirk's expression was apathetic, almost cold. Combined with his black armor, he gave off a dark and menacing aura. Though, this seemed to go totally unnoticed by the girl who stuck to him. The two couldn't look more opposite, one cheery and buttery, the other ruthless and frigid. The people who walked by this duo glanced at them strangely. He, I'm in a good mood. Are you in a good mood? Suddenly, Ava skipped around and bumped Dirk with her shoulder. He looked at her before looking around. I've been better. Huh? What's wrong? People look at us. Dirk spoke as his eyes flitted toward the various passerby. Ava tilted her head. So? I don't like being looked at. Since when? I thought you never cared about what people thought. That's why you went around school with a half-bald head for almost a month. Dirk was quiet as he remembered. It was indeed true that he didn't care about other people. No matter the names he was called or the weird ways people looked at him, he didn't even bat an eye. But now, for some reason, he was much more sensitive to the gazes of those around him. Pondering for a second, he suddenly looked at Ava. You. Huh. It's you. You made me self-conscious. Oh? Did I? But whatever do you have to be self-conscious over? Ava smiled mischievously as she stopped and hugged his arm. As she suddenly pushed her body against his, Dirk felt an unfamiliar but amazingly strong sense of embarrassment come over him. Ava whispered as her face pulled close to his. There are people watching. What if we kissed anyway? Nope. Hmm. As Dirk suddenly grabbed her wrist, Ava was confused. But then, his arms skillfully maneuvered and spun her body around. She was shocked as he lifted her arm behind her own back. Ack! Ah! I'm sorry. As Dirk lifted her arm into a lock with surprising force, Ava let out a small squeal. Hearing her plead, Dirk shook his head of embarrassment, 
calming himself. Let's go to the dungeon. I think we both need to kill some monsters and focus ourselves. Yes, yes, I understand. Good. With a nod, Dirk let Ava's arm go. She took a sharp breath as the lock released and pain subsided, swinging her shoulder. With a sigh, she turned around, about to scold Dirk a little for the unexpected shoulder lock. But when she did, she didn't see him. Dirk? Ava spun around, baffled by Dirk's silent disappearance. After a couple of spins though, she suddenly spotted a dark figure walking amidst the crowd of passers-by. Concentrating, she saw it was Dirk. Hey! Where are you going? With a step, Ava dashed over. Dirk turned his head toward her. You spotted me rather quickly. Please, I can never mistake your aura. And was that a magic? Like void walking? Aura, ha! Huh. And no, that wasn't a magic. You just need better situational awareness. I do not. Ava shouted as she took back up her position on Dirk's arm. As she further questioned him about that unexpected ability of his, the two continued heading toward the dungeon. Chapter 72 Elemental The job Dirk and Ava accepted was to kill the king of this dungeon and retrieve its tier for water mana crystal. And naturally, since the king of the dungeon was a water type monster, the rest of the monsters within the dungeon were water types as well. The dungeon was about 40 miles long from the entrance to the king's hall. However, this dungeon was peculiar in that it had two territories. The dungeon was divided up the middle and two monster species occupied the left and right sides. The first monster type on the left was a crocodile, at least that's what Dirk compared it to. These monsters were long and stuck near to the floor, attacking prey with their long snouts and razor-sharp teeth. Their hides were notoriously tough, and their bodies were filled with anima. Normally, Dirk wouldn't mind hunting such prey. The most valuable part of these crocodiles wasn't their mana crystals, but their tough hides that could be enchanted and used in armor. However, the monster Dirk came here for was the second type. On the right side of the dungeon were things called water elementals. These water elementals had bodies made entirely of water, making them basically impervious to physical attacks. Their fatal weakness though was the elemental core within them. This core was a big crystal ball the size of a head. This crystal core was exceptionally hard to destroy, but break it, and the elemental would die. Within the cores were the water mana crystals. Normally hunting the water elementals wouldn't be worth it. It took too much work to fight the elemental and then managed to break their core, thus getting the mana crystal. However, the reason these elementals were so popular was because not only were the crystal cores valuable, but the water mana crystals were more powerful than normal. Dirk found out from the Dungeon Association that these water mana crystals had much higher densities and purities than normal mana crystals. Smaller crystals but denser mana, all from monsters that weren't too hard to kill. It was very profitable. This was also the reason why the town around this particular dungeon was nicer than normal towns. This dungeon simply gave more money while requiring the same amount of effort. Dirk didn't have to, but he was most certainly planning on killing all the water elementals he could see on the way to the king. After all, he and Ava needed to understand them to ensure higher chances of success. However, although they knew that these elementals were more profitable, they didn't really understand just what that entailed. So when they finally entered the dungeon and saw crowds of people, they were shocked. The hell? Dirk was baffled as he looked at the haven near the entrance. There were so many people around this haven that they spilled outside of it. Dirk saw camps of people all around the haven fortress. Most people were waking up and packing their stuff so they could go hunt for the day. Still, for so many people to be in this dungeon was an odd sight. There were even vendors who cooked and sold food. Around it is then. Hmm. Ava nodded as Dirk started walking around the haven. They avoided all the people as they set off on the path to the king's hall. However, before they could get far, someone intercepted them. Dirk frowned as a tall man with scale leather armor blocked their path. He didn't have the nicest look on his face, obviously not in a good mood. You two kids aren't allowed to hunt. 
Dirk was silent as he looked at the man. His eyes narrowed, and it was clear he was now far from happy. Ava was quick to spot this and stepped forward in his stead. Why can't we hunt? There's a line. Only certain groups are allowed to go out each day. If we just let everyone go out and scour the dungeon for water elementals, they would be wiped from the dungeon. If you want to hunt, you'll have to join a group and wait until your group is allowed to hunt. How long would we have to wait? We cycle groups every day. There's three groups, and since you just joined, you would have to wait three days. Three days? Ava gawked. In three days, they could make their way through the entire damn dungeon. Dirk and Ava already had plans to make this trip quick, taking no longer than three days to kill the king. With that, they could have a round trip time of around ten days. But now, just being able to go and hunt would take three days, and who knew when they would be ready to face the king. In this case, this job would take them close to two weeks. Ava shook her head. We can't wait three days. Besides, we're not here to hunt. We're only here to kill the king. Kill the king? Please. Save yourself the air and just join the line. If I catch you two trying to sneak away, I'll have to throw you out of the dungeon. I'd like to see you try. Dirk sneered as the man took a step away. As he wasn't being quiet though, the man stopped and looked back, his face twisted a bit in anger. What did you just say? He scowled at Dirk. Before things could get worse though, Ava stepped forward again. Nothing. Look, we have a job to kill the king. If we can just dash. I don't care. Wait in line, or I'll kick your tiny asses out of this place myself. The man bellowed, causing Ava to go quiet. Now, even she was twitching in anger. She was realizing that this trip was positively fraught with conflict at every damned step. Because of Dirk her patience was high, but that was being rapidly sapped at. Hey! Suddenly, she stepped forward, her voice rising an octave. The man was about to snap, but then he saw Ava wave something around. See this? This is a job application from the Magic Academy of the capital city. Our job here is to kill the water elemental king and retrieve its mana crystal. This is my official student identification card. Take a good hard look at these two things, and then decide if you still want to hold us here. Better yet, go grab whoever is in charge. Otherwise, we might just have to walk over you and go to the king's hall anyway. Now, the man was silent under Ava's roars. The name of the Magic Academy was just too renowned, and everyone there was a magical freak of nature. Even some of the children there could kill those twice as old as them with a wave of the hand. While the man didn't take Ava's aggression seriously, he was now re-evaluating whether or not he could actually fight these two kids. Especially Dirk who gave off an aura bristling with violence. The man looked at Ava before swiping the job application and her student card. After seeing the official seal of the Magic Academy that glowed with magical power on both, his eye twitched. It looked like he kicked a rock today. Be on your way. With a low huff, the man threw the paper and card back to Ava. She caught it with a small smile. Thank you. We shall. Taking Dirk's hand, Ava sauntered off. Along the way, dozens of people looked at the two kids with envy. Not just because they were being let through, but because they were students of the Magic Academy. A majority of the people in that academy were nobles at the barest minimum. For all they knew, Dirk and Ava could be high nobles, and they wouldn't be wrong in that assumption. With that, the duo walked off into the dungeon. While Dirk's mood was still a bit sour, he was much happier. See? Not everything needs violence to solve. Unlike most, we have status. In times like these, it's better to just wave it around. After separating from the crowds, Ava spoke with a bit of arrogance. While she wasn't the child of a Marquis like Dirk, she was only a level lower. With her near-perfect water affinity at 97%, she was easily led into the Magic Academy, one of the largest and most renowned institutions in the entire world. She was absolutely right in that both of them enjoyed a status at the highest echelons of the Empire. 
a man like the one she just dealt with was lesser in status than the maids and butlers in her house. Only, when she was constantly surrounded by others with similar or higher classes like her, she forgot about this fact sometimes. Now, she wielded this power to solve a problem. It made her seem like a spoiled princess, but she preferred that over the alternative. She just didn't want Dirk to have to fight anyone. This was for his sake as well as the health of those unlucky people who got on his bad side. Status shouldn't matter. While Dirk agreed with Ava, he still spoke this point. That man had no common decency, and if he did, then things wouldn't have gotten hostile. It could have been solved nicely and Dirk would still be in a good mood. Surprisingly, Ava agreed. You're partially right. In fact, status doesn't matter. It's the power behind that status. Power is everything here. There's power behind the name of the Magic Academy. There's power behind your family name. You also have the power to beat that guy into a bloody pulp. All of these things could have solved that problem. It's just a matter of choosing which would solve it better. If throwing out a name in some papers gets us by, then I'll choose that over having to expend effort on fighting some nobody. I guess. Dirk found himself nodding at Ava's statement. She was right. Not only here, but in this world of sword and magic, power was everything. There was no need for common decency if one was powerful enough to do as they wished. If Dirk and Ava were commoners with power lesser than that man, then they could do nothing but wait like everyone else. But with the power of a name and especially personal power, they could directly bypass all those things. It was like how Dirk enforced his bottom line only the day before with sheer power. He made his point with his fists. That's what it took in this world. While morality wasn't completely thrown out the window, it was further bent to the whims of the strong than on some place like Earth. Dirk was enlightened a bit as he thought of the meaning of power. More and more he was adapting to the dynamic of this world, and Ava was shaping that view once more. He looked at her. Well, aren't you wiser than you look? Huh? What the hell does that mean? I'll have you know that I am a very graceful and distinguished young woman and very wise for my age group. You just don't see it since I'm your only friend in the entire academy. Ava flickered her hair as she spoke with the demeanor of a queen. Dirk just snickered. Ah. Uh -huh. Plus, I have friends. No, you have a friend. Alec is the only one you've ever talked to. Well, you plus Alec makes two. That's more than one so I have friends. Ha ha. Sure, sure. Ava couldn't help but laugh as Dirk made his defense. He also smiled and chuckled, his good mood returning to him. Like that, the two walked deep into the dungeon. It wasn't obvious near the entrance of the dungeon since it had been modified by the Dungeon Association, but the dungeon was actually something of a jungle. The sun above was blocked by the tall and thick trees while the ground was covered in thick brush. However, this wasn't a normally green and vibrant jungle either. In the water elemental territory Dirk and Ava were in, the jungle was blue and black. This made the surroundings look much darker than normal, as if it weren't even daytime. Plus, as they got deeper in, the duo encountered a thick fog. This fog was actually filled with water mana, so it not only blocked normal senses but obscured mana sense. This would usually be fine. Dirk didn't have any problems trekking through a jungle. But one problem they constantly encountered was the abundant water in the area that formed small murky pools on the ground as well as small rivers crisscrossing everywhere. He wanted to complain as his armor got wet but this was a water-type dungeon, so he could only deal with it. Well, this is at least better than blistering heat. Ava mumbled as they hopped from the huge exposed roots of a tree over a running stream of water. As their boots splashed in a mossy pool on the other side, Dirk sighed. You better be using nothing but magic here. This is the perfect place for you. We'll see if my water magic can actually harm a monster made of water. Actually, you're probably going to be doing most of the heavy lifting, Mr. Fire Mage. Ava poked Dirk with her elbow as they walked along something of a path. For a while the two didn't see any water elementals, but that was likely because of how popular they were to hunt. Dirk was sure that every time one of those groups was let out every day, 
every monster in sight would be promptly wiped from existence. So although it took them a while, the duo eventually spotted one of these elementals. From behind a large tree, Dirk and Ava observed a large blob of water whose body flowed with thick water mana. The blob was a simple sphere about eight feet in diameter, and its bottom glided across the surface of the ground to move, like a flat tire. Dirk and Ava were surprised by the size. That thing is huge. Oh, there's its core. Ava suddenly pointed as she spotted a glimmer within the water elemental. In the middle of its body floated a huge crystal about a foot in diameter. The crystal was translucent, and in the very center of this crystal was a small blue orb the size of a marble. This was the mana crystal. So we need to break the core to kill it. And we can take both the core and mana crystal as harvested material. Only, the core is really big. We can't hold very many, maybe one or two at most inside your ring alongside all our other items. Hmm. Well, time to practice. What tier is this elemental? HM, I would say the middle of tier 2. Ava guessed as she felt the power of the water mana radiating from the elemental. Hearing that, Dirk nodded. All right. There's not much threat. Experiment with it and see how well your water magic does. Okay. With that, Ava stepped out from behind the tree. After taking a few obvious steps, the water elemental seemed to spot her. Without warning, two streams of water were launched from the body, threatening to crash into Ava head-on. Of course, such an attack was child's play to Ava. Her face was neutral as she brought up and pointed two fingers. On the back of her hand, runes were suddenly formed while a magic circuit was constructed. This spell had three circles and over a dozen runes. This was obviously a higher level spell than normal. And in fact, it was one of the spells she had chosen after going back to her classes. After a second to complete the spell, the magic circle flashed, and Ava's hand moved. Her two fingers streaked through the air, a line of water being left behind. From her left shoulder to her right hip, a blade of water was instantly formed. And once it formed, it was fired. The water blade sliced through the air and toward the two streams. Crash! Despite the water blade being thin, the two streams of water exploded outward upon colliding. The water blade sliced through and obliterated both streams before continuing toward the elemental. Seeing this deadly attack, the elemental's water body shook before sending out more streams of water. But they were all destroyed by the water blade. The water blade was unstoppable as it cut into the elemental's body, crashing into the core. Crack! When the blade hit, the core instantly chipped and cracked. However, it wasn't completely broken. The water elemental's body, upon being injured, felt a huge amount of its body flood away. It was quickly reduced to only three feet in diameter. Good job! Seeing this, Dirk walked out and stood beside Ava. The water elemental continued to attack them, but its attacks were nothing more than little splashes of water. In fact, it weakened by the second, water mana flooding from its core. It would soon die without them doing anything. A single water blade. So we know that nothing in the shallow areas can harm us. And it seems your water mana is effective. The same element from two different people will still collide as two separate magics. It's all about who the mana belongs to. Though, it takes a bit more brute force. Try your magic next time. Your fire magic is a direct counter, but your earth magic would also be good with its rigidity. All right. Let's see if we can find another one. But first, time to harvest. Saying that, Dirk walked over to the dying elemental. Its body had already almost completely drained away, so Dirk grabbed its core with his hands and stuck his fingers in the cracks. With a bit of force, he pulled the core apart like shattering glass, the mana crystal within dropping to the floor. Ava grabbed the mana crystal, feeling the water mana within. She was surprised. Despite the elemental only being a tier 2, the mana density was that of a tier 3. While it exchanged that for lesser total mana volume, gathering enough crystals would reconcile that. No wonder the elementals were so popular. 
At least the harvesting is clean, albeit a bit wet. Come on. Dropping the head-sized core, Dirk turned and continued walking through the thick jungle. He definitely preferred this over digging through flesh and bones. Ava pocketed the mana crystal before following. Chapter 73, Misdirection Slash Wait Not long after they defeated the first elemental, Dirk and Ava found the second. It was here that Dirk stepped out and tested his magic. After having completed his advancement to Tier 3, Dirk's earth magic was, if used in the right way, his most powerful weapon. His mana pool was massive compared to before, his regeneration was much swifter, and he was most proficient with the magic. Compared to that, his fire magic was incredibly lacking despite having recently learned a new spell. This was because he had only formed the single earth and mana heart. His next steps were to form mana hearts for the dark and fire elements. But that would take time, so for now, he much preferred to use earth magic. Stepping up to the elemental, Dirk was quickly attacked with two jet streams of water. However, he didn't dodge as he raised his hand. A magic circle appeared on his palm. This was casting by his own power, not utilizing the AI. Thus, it took around a second before the spell was completed. After it was though, two rock arrows appeared above his head. Only, these rock arrows were different. Normally, Dirk's rock arrows appeared as gray stone. Now though, they had a bit of a metallic sheen with metal chunks comprising the body. They were heavier, stronger, and sharper. This was a consequence of Dirk's intake of metal mana during his advancement. The metal mana his mother supplied was incredibly thick, so when it was absorbed, it spilled into the other half of his mana pool where his basic earth mana was. Thus, all of his magic that used the earth mana from his mana pool automatically took on metallic attributes. Only, Dirk had yet to actually test the effects. Bringing his hand down, the two rock arrows above his head went flying. The two streams of water also crashed into him, but Dirk's body was able to resist the impact. It only served to get him wet. The two metallic arrows flew faster than ever before, silently slicing through the air as they target the elemental's core. The elemental wasn't able to react before the two arrows pierced into its water body and punched through without resistance. Before long, the two arrows met the core. With a small impact, the core was directly split open. Both arrows passed straight through it, and the elemental's water body immediately lost its form, spilling across the floor. Ava was surprised as the arrows planted themselves in the ground behind the now-dead elemental. Dirk was also surprised. As he threw the arrows, he noticed how he could put much more power behind them than before. This was a result of his soul having grown during his advancement. This combined with his metallic mana made for an especially sharp and deadly strike, one that could take out the elemental in one hit. Oh yeah, you're definitely going to be the most effective one in this dungeon. Ava snickered as she looked at Dirk. While she could fight the elementals with her stronger power, she was forced to be very direct and brutish about it since the enemies were composed of water. But with Dirk's rigid and piercing earth magic, he could easily get through their attacks and defenses just like he demonstrated. It took much less effort than on her part. Hearing her though, Dirk only smirked. What, you think you're going to get out of fighting? You take the next one. We'll switch off after every enemy. Huh. That's so not fair. I don't care. This is a water dungeon, and you're a water mage. Besides, I can't keep getting wet like this. Ah, scared of a little water? Take this. Suddenly raising her hand, Ava conjured a ball of water and launched it at Dirk. To this attack, he quickly dodged, but when the ball hit the ground, it exploded, showering him with more water. He frowned as his armor dripped, the leather sopping wet. Ha ha ha. See? It's not that. Wait, what are you doing? Come on, give me a hug. Wait, no. Ah. Ava screamed as Dirk suddenly ran over to her. She tried to escape, but he quickly grabbed her arm, pulling her into his cold and wet embrace. No. You're cold. See? It's not that bad. Just a little water. 
I'm sure that as a water mage, this doesn't bother you at all. Hey, I'm sorry. I'll dry you off. As Dirk hugged her tighter, Ava apologized through the smothering and activated her mana. The mana washed over Dirk, seeping into his clothes and bringing the water out with it. Dirk was surprised as his armor became perfectly dry. You could do that? It works just like how you can take control of dirt or whatever. Now stop squeezing. He, okay. Dirk chuckled as he released Ava. She backed away, straightening her armor and removing any water from her own body. Dirk glanced at her before looking around. All right, now you get to fight the next two elementals. Huh? No. We already agreed on switching off. That was before you splashed me. Ah. I'm sorry, okay? You want a kiss to make you feel better? Taking a step, Ava moved her body close to Dirk's with a small smile, brushing up against him. Seeing her going for the kill, Dirk's eyes widened before he skillfully stepped out of the way. Nope, that's all right. Hey! Come on, give me a kiss. Come catch me then. As Ava suddenly doved toward him, Dirk smirked before shifting his stance. He sidestepped her before leaping behind a tree, taking a step out of view. When Ava turned around to chase him, she found that he was mysteriously gone. She spun around, carefully looking through the trees around her. Then, she found his figure, looking at her with a small smile. Hey! How do you do that? Misdirection. Let's see how well you can follow me. Challenge accepted. My senses are fantastic even among my race. I can easily sense your aura. As Ava spoke her eyes followed Dirk's figure. However, when he walked behind another tree, he disappeared again. She went quiet for a second before dashing over. Looking around where he used to be at, she found no hint that he was there. She spun around, a more serious light in her eyes. You can hide your body, but not your mind. She mumbled. As she had inherited from her father, Ava had the mystical ability to sense the state of minds, and by extension, minds themselves. This was why she could pick Dirk out in a crowd. She could sense his unique mind and aura. This was also why she was confident being able to follow him. But now, she found no hint of him. Not even looking at the foliage revealed any sort of trail. He had vanished into thin air. Of course, Ava knew that he hadn't actually vanished. There was only so far he could go in a certain amount of time, and he was heading for the next haven anyway. That gave her a direction. What was shocking though was how silently he moved. He was a ghost. Starting now, I'm going to be jogging to the haven. I hope you can keep up. Hey! Suddenly, Ava heard Dirk's voice. She whipped around to see him standing only thirty feet from her next to a tree. This caused her to feel a small wave of goosebumps. He had so easily snuck up to her. Dirk smiled before taking another step. Seeing him about to vanish again, Ava broke out into a sprint, running right toward him. Before she could get to him though, he walked behind a tree. Only a second later, Ava ran around that same tree, but he was gone. She looked all around her ears picking up on any sound they possibly could and eyes keeping out for any hand of aura. Luckily, a second wasn't enough to go far. After looking all around, she barely caught a glimpse of something moving behind a tall bush. Ava ran over, crashing straight through the bush and spinning her head around. Ava's eyes glanced at every tree and plant. She even looked up in the trees, making sure he wasn't climbing around like a monkey. But like last time, she couldn't even find a trace of his movement. But she did see something else. Perhaps it was because she became more focused, but Ava could see a remnant wisp in the man around a particular tree. Seeing this odd disturbance, she immediately ran over. Meanwhile, Dirk was already moving from the tree that Ava was running to. But as he heard her run in his direction, he was surprised. She had found him so quickly. Interesting. I left no trace, but she still found where I went. Is it my aura? Or maybe the man around me? There's more I have to account for. Well, this will be good practice. Thinking that, 
Dirk kicked his movement up a notch. He moved from trees to bushes and behind large rocks. His steps were silent, his body nimble, and his movements accurate. He barely left behind footsteps. He moved forward at a quick pace for half an hour. Despite this, Ava was able to keep up shockingly well. It was only a few times that Dirk had to give her hints when he lost her. All other times, she was able to keep hot on his trail. It was in these instances that Dirk tried out different things in an attempt to mask the invisible trail he left. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to come up with much. Dirk knew that moving through anything would disturb Mana, and he knew that it was this that likely gave his position away. But not disturbing Mana was easier said than done. It wasn't simply withholding the Mana inside oneself. It was like trying to run forward without disturbing the air. By normal means, it was impossible. One had to adopt certain techniques in order to mask their effect on the surroundings. Dirk had achieved mastery in doing so physically, but now he had to do it magically. And doing so magically was much harder. Still, Dirk began to practice, keeping his senses locked on the man around him and his effects on it. Like this, the two made their way deeper into the dungeon. From the entrance to the King's Hall on the right was forty miles of forest, and there was a haven between these two areas as well as a haven next to the King's Hall. Normally it would take several hours while walking to cross twenty miles, but at the pace they were going, they would only arrive in two. Because of this, Dirk decided they could head straight for the King's Hall. Of course, he didn't plan on just running there. Along the way, any elementals he came across were taken care of. Sometimes he would kill them himself and other times he would stop and wait for Ava, letting her take care of it before running off again. With that they gained experience, preparing for the battle with the king. In fact, Dirk was a bit expectant to fight the king. Not just because of the reward, but because he could only fight elementals with his magic. He couldn't reach their cores with his weapons, so magic was the only way. This wasn't a bad thing, and he wanted to stress his magical power. He needed to learn to rely on magic more because it was an essential part of his combat ability. However, he knew the king wouldn't be an easy fight. So he was especially experimental with the elementals. He tried using his rock arrows as well as his improved fireballs. Unsurprisingly though, the fireballs were quite a bit less efficient than the rock arrows since they went against water, their direct counter. On the contrary, his arrows were exceptionally effective, cracking open the cores every time. The only thing that annoyed Dirk was the occasional splash of water that got him wet. This continued for a few hours. During these hours, Dirk and Ava ran non-stop to the furthest haven, their only times of rest being their fights with elementals. As they got deeper, the elementals got stronger and also more plentiful. They eventually rose to tier 3 and would appear in groups of 4. This was still tolerable though, so the two weren't delayed by much. After a while, they finally found the haven. In around 4 hours, they had crossed 40 miles. Despite this, neither of them were tired. Dirk was at the peak of rank 3, and Ava wasn't far behind. For them, running without using anima was easy, especially with their prior training. The only thing that limited them was the difficult terrain of the forest. In fact, because this terrain was unfamiliar for Ava, she had tripped a great many times. While she was able to catch herself most of the time, she had also eaten dirt several other times. Not long after Dirk found the haven, he spotted Ava walk out of the forest behind him. Seeing her, he couldn't help but chuckle a bit. Her armor and hair had mud in them, and she couldn't clean herself since she had to keep up with Dirk. She didn't look that happy. Hey! Clean me! Clean you? Yeah, with your magic. Get this dirt out of my hair. Unless you want to help me in the bath? And no, that's alright. With a small stutter, Dirk readily agreed and walked over, using his magic to get the dirt out of Ava's hair and off her armor. He was hesitant about how far they had gone already, and he would not go and start taking baths with her as well. With a wave of mana, Ava became mostly clean. A bit of water and she would be good as new. With a smile, she glued herself to Dirk's side, the two approaching the haven. 
Rather unfortunately though, the haven wasn't empty like Dirk expected it to be. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Dirk once again underestimated how popular this dungeon was. Inside the haven were many groups of people with tents pitched all around the area. While it wasn't full, there were still many groups. It was not a comforting sight to Dirk. He and Ava walked in, and sure enough, there was someone to approach them. Hello you two. Mind if I ask what your business here is? A man approached, medium in stature and radiating earth mana. He was a mage with short hair and clean face. This made sense since the elementals were much harder to fight with just weapons. Because this man approached without a sense of hostility, Dirk wasn't immediately on guard. Still, being confronted at all for the second time and a day didn't make him happy. Ava spoke as his gaze bore into the man, obviously not very friendly. We're here to fight the king. This is our mission from the Magic Academy. So you both are Academy students, huh? All right. Normally I'd be happy to just let you go and fight, but we've got a few groups who also want to fight the king. Unfortunately I'm going to have to ask you to wait behind the others. How long is the wait? Ava asked hesitantly. She and Dirk had made great time getting here. In a usual situation, they would wait until tomorrow, fight the king, and then be out of the dungeon by the end of the day. They could be on a wagon going home by the third day, making for a total trip time of around a week. This was an exceptional completion time. But now it turned out they would have to wait, and they wouldn't likely be able to get around this like they did the man who didn't want to let them by at the entrance. The mage rubbed his chin. Upon a successful kill, the king takes a day to respawn. The group for today fought not long ago, and there were two other groups behind them. If today is day one, then you two will be able to fight on day four, so two days after today. Ava was quiet hearing this. This would extend their stay by a few more days. She really didn't want to wait, but she also didn't want to be unreasonable and force her way in. This was a reasonable predicament that they couldn't get around. Dirk also didn't say anything. His thoughts were the same as Ava's. After thinking for a second, he could only resign himself. He spoke. Fine. We'll wait. Thank you. Go ahead and set up camp. There is food to buy if you need it. And in the meantime, feel free to go out and hunt. Unlike the shallow areas of the dungeon that are cleared out day by day, there are plentiful and stronger elementals out here, meaning more money to be made. Can't let your time go to waste, right? With those words, the mage walked off. Ava and Dirk were silent for a bit. Well, at least he's nice. Hmm. Let's go find camp. Dirk nodded at Ava's assessment before entering the haven. They could see several groups comprised of at least three people each, and each group was clustered together with obvious space separating them. Finding an open spot in the midst of these groups, Dirk and Ava pitched their single tent. They earned plenty of stairs since it was just them, but they paid it no heed. With that, the two decided to rest for the day. After removing their armor, the two climbed into the tent. It was here that they did a bit of mana cultivation. As Dirk was now a tier 3 mage, his next step was to create a mana heart for his other two attributes, fire and dark. Since he had been distracted ever since his advancement, he hadn't started forming either of these hearts. Now, he had some free time, so he figured he could begin the process. And with his previous experience and greater strength, Dirk knew he could form these hearts much faster. After taking a look at his technique, he found that the book wanted him to form one heart at a time. By doing this, he would go through the same process as when he advanced for each attribute, forming a proper mana pool for each one. In the end, he would have a mana pool for each element, effectively multiplying his total mana storage. It would also increase his strength since the soul would become stronger to accommodate the extra mana pools. However, according to the book, forming the rest of his mana pools would only bring him to the middle of tier 3. After this came a strengthening process that would raise him to tier 4. Until then, Dirk needed to first concentrate on his next heart. Thinking for a bit, Dirk decided that he would form his fire heart first. 
While he only knew the improved fireball spell, it was better than his dark magic where he knew nothing. He hadn't even started practicing things like void walking or curse of darkness. Plus, fire magic was extremely destructive. This would complement his earth magic that was more defensive. With that decision made, Dirk began practicing. However, it was also here that he turned his attention to one of his other specialties. Chapter 74 Elemental King Like Dirk's earth attribute, Dirk's fire attribute had a specialization. It was lightning, and just like when he was forming his earth mana heart, Dirk needed to condense the fire mana heart with equal amounts of fire and lightning. So he attempted to bring in both lightning mana and fire mana. However, perhaps because this was a water type dungeon, Dirk found that these two elements weren't so prevalent around him. It took a while to condense enough to even begin practicing, and with only a thin amount of mana, the results wouldn't be great. Because of this, he stopped after a couple of hours with a sigh. It didn't seem like he would be able to cultivate at all, and he didn't have any mana crystals to supplement with either. Thankfully, magic wasn't all he had to practice. Thinking, Dirk started to draw runes in the air, practicing his enchanting. He didn't need much mana to engage in elemental comprehension, so for a while, runic symbols flashed within the tent. Not only that, but because Dirk had a large earth mana pool, he could practice his earth guard magic, conjuring plates of rock around his body. Like with his rock arrows, all the pieces of earth armor took on metallic properties. Getting to this point, Dirk thought a bit and tried injecting some metal mana into his earth spells. When this happened, his formations became stronger and heavier. However, when he injected enough, the spell started to fall apart. Metal mana was still different than earth mana, so it operated by different rules. Dirk couldn't use the same spell with earth mana. But he could try tampering with it. Engaging his AI, he went on to try and form his own runes bridging the gap between earth and metal in order to utilize metal in his spells. Surprisingly, Dirk was able to garner small success. Going little by little, he learned how to subtly change the runes in his spell responsible for moving mana and adapt them to metal. With that, the spell became a bit more complex, but he was able to increase the metal content in his formations. This pleased him greatly. With metal, his spells would jump greatly in lethality and defense. Only, the success took him until the end of the night, and his energy had been sapped at. When Ava called it a night, he also decided to go to sleep. Like that, the two fell asleep under a single blanket, Ava getting more and more comfortable with using Dirk's body as a pillow. Over the next two days, Dirk and Ava didn't spend all their time idling about and practicing. After sleeping in every morning, they would get up and go out to hunt. While hunting, they got progressively more proficient at fighting the elementals. Taking turns, they would fight against groups of high-tier three elementals by themselves. This posed its own challenges to both of them, but it was the best way to get ready for the battle with the king. Of the two, Dirk had the easiest time. His metallic arrows were the perfect counter to these elementals. Their spread and liquid attacks couldn't concentrate enough to totally repel his arrows, especially with his greater magical strength behind them. Like that, he was able to break apart every core he came across. The only thing he needed to worry about was his accuracy and the attacks that came at him. Thankfully, Dirk also learned how to use Earth Guard as defense, providing another layer of security on top of his armor. This could resist water blades and explosive balls of water that the elementals launched at him. And unlike Dirk, Ava had a harder time. As she said, fighting the elementals was a battle of brute force. She had to punch through water with her own concentrated attacks of water. Each lone battle would take quite a while. However, her gains from these battles weren't just in the form of combat experience. Ava had an almost perfect affinity with the water element, only a bit lesser than Rita who had a perfect affinity with the dark element. And like Rita, Ava was turning out to be a bit of a genius when it came to the water element. During her battles with the elementals, Ava was constantly watching the movement of water mana within the elementals. She saw how they gathered it and ejected it. Unlike people who formed magic circles and spells, these elementals were one with the element, 
and they displayed a fluid and silent way of moving water mana, manifesting its effects. While she couldn't totally copy their techniques, Ava was able to garner some inspiration from them. Over the course of two days, her casting time was reduced greatly and her spell formation became much more efficient. She even learned how to cast her low-level water ball and water wall spells silently, showing no magic circle in the process. This was true silent casting that boasted near-instant casting speeds. Dirk was surprised to see this. Not even he could silent cast so well. After all, silent casting involved the direct manifestation of a spell's effects. In the words of several teachers, silent casting was basically the direct manipulation of mana, transforming it without the assistance of runes. Runes were the language of magic, so casting things without them meant you were communicating directly with mana. It was the difference between writing a letter and getting a response and talking straight to another person. It was a difficult thing to do, requiring a deep comprehension of one's element. Seeing Ava do this though, Dirk started pondering how he would do it too. He didn't want to fall behind, and silent casting was very appealing to him who sought subtlety and speed. Of course, this required him to form spells himself and learn their secrets. If Dirk kept using his AI to cast, he wouldn't learn much. So he made a resolution to only use instant casting in times of necessity. Otherwise, he would cast things himself. Like this, the duo fought until the day their battle with the king was planned. And on day number four, it was time. You too, it's your turn. On the morning of, the mage who spoke to Dirk and Ava upon their arrival greeted them at their tent. By now, the two were already geared and ready. They had been up for two hours, waiting and settling themselves for the fight. As Dirk packed items into his ring, Ava turned to the mage. Thank you. Is there any advice you can give us? Advice? H.M. The mage rubbed his chin for a second. Don't panic if you have to wear the king down. For many people, this king forces them into a battle of attrition. If you get worn out first, you'll be killed. That's why all the groups here have at least three people, so they can switch off and fight over time. Honestly, just the two of you is pushing things, but you're from the academy, so I can't say anything about your power. Hmm. Thank you. Sure. The hall is open. Enter when you're ready. Then we'll be off. With that, Dirk and Ava bid goodbye. The mage watched as the two headed for the black dungeon portal, sinking into that murky wall before disappearing. After walking through the entrance, Dirk and Ava were placed into a large area with two rows of tall blue trees on the left and right sides. These rows that comprised the king's hall guided them forward to the doors of the king's chambers. In their way were three enemies. Enemies found in the king's hall were usually called the king's guards. The three guards were all elementals. In the shallow areas of the dungeon, Dirk and Ava saw tier two elementals that had bodies about eight feet in diameter. These guards had bodies about 14 feet in diameter, and with three of them in the way, they seemed to seal off all paths forward. Of course, Dirk and Ava weren't planning on trying to sneak past these guards. If they couldn't kill them, then they would die by the king's hand. So they moved forward, launching their attacks. They're stronger than the strongest enemies we found in the deep areas of the dungeon. Low tier force. All right. Dirk nodded at Ava's evaluation. In the Lizard Dungeon, they had faced high rank enemies around rank 4. With their magic and strength, Dirk and Ava were able to face the enemies, even kill the Lizard King despite being hurt. But these enemies were impervious to any physical attacks. Their rank wouldn't help them much and could only be used defensively. Thus, they had to use nothing but the power afforded to them by their tier. Both Dirk and Ava were low tier threes. Normally it wouldn't be feasible for them to fight enemies that were an entire tier above them. But neither of these two people were normal. Dirk's magic was the perfect counter to these enemies, and Ava had great comprehensive strength with only her single element to focus on. They could fight monsters above their tier. The duo let out their attacks. Dirk raised his hand, and after two seconds, three gray arrows appeared above his head. These were the metallic arrows he had been working on. 
Ava also brought up her two fingers, tracing them across her body. With that, a blade of water was created, and she attacked one of the three elementals. Their attacks flew. Dirk threw one arrow with the power of his mental energy, the arrow flying at breakneck speeds. The target elemental reacted by shooting balls of water out that exploded on the arrow. This caused the arrow to diverge, still hitting its large body but clearly missing its core. Seeing this, Dirk moved again before launching out his other two arrows. These two moved even faster, and while one was barely diverted, the other kept true, heading straight for the elemental's core. Ting! An acute sound rang out as the tip of the arrow poked the core. This caused cracks to appear on the surface of the core, but it wasn't lethally wounded. Some of the elemental's body flooded away, shrinking down as mana escaped the core. Dirk jumped on this chance, conjuring three more arrows and launching them all toward the wounded elemental. But at that time, the elemental that wasn't being handled by Ava launched an attack, two blades of water flying at Dirk. Normally this would be an attack to dodge, but Dirk didn't want to let up. Suddenly, he waved his arm, and a wall of metallic rock shot out of the ground. Dirk dodged one blade while the other crashed into the wall that Dirk retreated behind. Bang! The blade crashed into the wall, gouging out a huge chunk of it and almost slicing it in half. Dirk was surprised at the force before running out and continuing his attack. Right after stepping away from the wall, Dirk threw three arrows out. The injured elemental released its own defensive attacks, and the second elemental launched even more attacks at Dirk, but the arrows were already gone. With an expected outcome, Dirk watched as two of his three arrows crashed into the core, shattering it directly. With that, one elemental was dead. Dirk dodged one of the oncoming attacks from the second elemental before tanking another with a conjured plate of armor, his earth guard spell showing its defensive prowess. After that, he focused on the second enemy. At the same time, Ava continued to battle her enemy. Blades of water were constantly created, slicing into the elemental's body and cutting it open. Only, the body was tough and would simply seal itself back up, not letting Ava reach its core. Seeing this, she changed tactics. Both of her hands were raised. Above one, three small balls of water appeared. Above the other, two blades were created. She launched these attacks as fast as she could, staggering them. In front, a ball of water was intercepted by the elemental's defensive attack. The two took each other out. Then, one of the other balls of water behind that took the brunt of yet another defensive attack just outside of the elemental's body. However, then came a blade, and it sliced right into the body of water. A large gouge was created in the elemental's body by the blade. Following it, the last ball of water came in and exploded within that gouge, opening it up even further until the core was exposed. Then, the final blade came down, crashing into the core. The core cracked almost in half, the full brunt of the blade bearing down on it. The elemental's body instantly shrunk by a large margin, and its mana leaked out uncontrollably. Taking this chance, Ava pressed another attack with two more water blades. The two blades cut through any weak attacks the elemental threw out and chopped into its body, cutting down the core. Ava smiled, feeling a bit tired. That chain of attacks had taken a lot of concentration, brute forcing her way to the core of the elemental. It was this reason why she found fighting them difficult. Turning, Ava went and joined Dirk in finishing the last one. After opening a path for him with her blades, Dirk's arrow sunk straight into the elemental piercing its core. While the core wasn't split in half, it was still irreversibly damaged with an arrow through it. Thus, the elemental died. Sheesh. That was a bit tougher than I thought. Ava let out a long breath. She could already feel a bit of exhaustion creep in. Dirk nodded as he went over to the cores and pried out the mana crystals. Although he had a much easier time, he still had to expend mental energy forming his new and improved metallic arrows. Just casting the spell took longer since he was now doing things by himself. Dirk knew that the king would be a level harder than these guards. Going off of this difficulty, fighting the king was risky. Luckily, there was only one king. 
and if what that mage said was true and things usually became a battle of attrition, then Dirk felt they would be safe. At the very least, he had no trouble preserving their lives from such a monster. But it would be another tough battle, especially given their lesser tier. They were fighting an entire tier above them, possibly higher. Just this fact caused Dirk to frown. If he had his fire mana heart, then he would be much more confident, but he only had his earth mana at his disposal. After harvesting the crystals, Dirk and Ava took a seat by the large black doors to the king's chambers. They rested for a couple of hours until they were in peak shape. After that, they stood, facing the doors. Are we sure? Dirk asked hesitantly. He truly hated how the king's chambers were a path of no return. What if they entered and immediately discovered that the king was beyond them? They could only wait to die then. But those were the rules. Thankfully the guards at least served as a gauge to the king's power. Ava was silent for a bit, thinking about the potential power of the king. I think? That's not very reassuring. Well you tell me. You're better at this stuff than I am. Let's just make sure we're working together. Take it slow at first and learn its patterns. At the beginning, we can stick to defense. By any means, do not get injured. I won't. I'm not gonna hold you back. Ava spoke seriously, looking at Dirk with determined eyes. He had already done a lot for her, and she wasn't about to become baggage. Then let's go. Full commitment. Taking a shallow breath, Dirk put out his hand. Ava nodded and took it, the two walking to the door. With their free hands, they pushed, entering the king's chambers. You are entering the king's hall. Behold, elemental king of water. Dirk's muscles went taut as a message reached his mind. Looking forward, they could immediately see their enemy. The doors closed behind them, sealing shut. The two challengers looked at the king. In the middle of a ring of tall trees was a field of grass and mud. In the center of this field was a single blob of water. It looked just like all the other elementals that Dirk and Ava had faced before. However, this blob was only eight feet in diameter. It was the same size as the weakest elementals in the dungeon. But this fact wasn't comforting. Seeing the smaller size, Dirk frowned, as did Ava. Both knew that within that elemental was an explosive power. Not long after they entered, Dirk raised his hand. Two seconds later, three of his metallic arrows were formed. He launched these three arrows at the same time, each one flying in a straight path at the elemental. Only, none of them hit. As they flew, the elemental released three balls of water, each one intercepting an arrow. Upon collision, the balls exploded, sending the arrows spinning off in other directions. That's not good. Ava was intimidated. Each ball of water was pressurized, making their explosion that much more violent. And while Dirk might not understand the power it took to pressurize water, she did. If she tried, it would take a large portion of her power in order to pressurize the water that much. But that elemental had casually thrown out such attacks. Split up, and don't stop moving. Dodge attacks. Suddenly, the elemental launched out a few blades of water. Dirk reacted quickly, throwing out those words and running to the side. Ava also took off in the opposite direction. With that, the battle with the king commenced. Chapter 75 Battle After the first exchange of attacks, Dirk and Ava were bombarded by many more blades and balls of pressurized water. The elemental king bore down on them, not giving them a moment of rest. Neither of them launched any more attacks either. The duo kept moving in their own separate ways, dodging all the attacks they could. Since the elemental had no face and such, it had no problem attacking them even when they were on opposite sides of it. The two gave up on trying to sneak attack it like with the Lizard King. They spent ten minutes jumping around the elemental. Because both of them were anima trainers, they could run around for hours and their instantaneous movement speed was high, allowing them to dodge for however long they needed to. This was a great assurance that made Dirk confident in a battle of attrition. Otherwise he wouldn't be willing to risk getting tired. 
Dirk didn't know how anyone who didn't train Anima would handle themselves in this place unless they were at least at the level of the king. With that, Dirk and Ava entered something of a lull in the battle. Dirk kept observing, watching how the king would launch water balls and blades. He saw how long it took to form attacks, the speed of the attacks, their accuracy, their frequency, their range, and their power. He grasped all the details he could, then planned how he could bring about the king's demise. Thinking, Dirk dodged an attack before creating an arrow. When another attack was thrown, Dirk threw his at the same time. In this gap of time, the elemental wasn't able to release another attack. The arrow hit the body of water just as Dirk dodged the blade of water that threatened to take his legs off. Pop! When the arrow hit the elemental, a sharp sound was released. The arrow pierced into the elemental, sinking into its body. However, the next moment a heavy water pressure shot the arrow right back out of its body. A burst of water came out of the hole that Dirk made, spraying water everywhere like a burst pipe. The elemental flooded water for a few seconds before the hole was sealed. Dirk and Ava watched this. When the hole was being sealed, the elemental only threw out one attack. Its focus had been on repairing itself, a process that apparently took energy. This gave both Dirk and Ava ideas. They realized what that mage meant when he mentioned wearing down the king. If they could keep attacking and poking holes, the king would drain energy. It took lots of energy anyway to pressurize water, and the king wasted a lot of energy when throwing out strong attacks that constantly missed. Ava! With an idea, Dirk suddenly shouted across the field. Throw attacks at it, and make it recover. But conserve your energy. This battle could take a while, so don't get tired before this thing does. Got it. Time your attacks for when it throws its own. Go! With that shout, Dirk cast a spell, as did Ava. He created five rock arrows while she created three water blades. After that, they waited for the right moment to strike. Then, when the king sent out attacks on both of them, they sent their own. The two attacks passed each other, one of Ava's blades and one of Dirk's arrows breaking the body of the king open. They also dodged the attacks thrown at them. Pop! Another small explosion was heard as two holes were opened on the king's body. Water sprayed like a fountain for several seconds this time before closing up, soaking the ground underneath with a pool of water. Seeing that, Dirk threw two more of his arrows, while Ava threw her two other blades. For more attacks came flying, and the king sent out its own to intercept. Only, throwing out more attacks increased the time its body lost water. The holes stayed open at the cost of the attacks being defended against. When Dirk sent his last arrow, another hole was opened. The ground was soaked even further. This only lasted for a few seconds though. The holes quickly sealed themselves, and after, the king released a heavy barrage of attacks. Dirk was surprised as twelve blades of water flew out of the king's body, half toward him and Ava. The blades of water showered down on top of them. Dirk ran, pillars of rock throwing him across the field. However, the blades curved, following as best they could. Dirk scoffed before stopping and facing them. When the six flew at him, he dodged at the last second. At the same time, a thick metallic wall was created in front of him. With the angle he created this wall at, three of the blades flew by him, but the other three landed. Bang! The blades cut into the wall. Shockingly, Dirk watched as his wall was directly sliced open. He saw one blade take the top of the wall off while another blade cut through the wall and slid right past his front, only inches away from his face. The last blade hit the side of the wall, passing by his body. What was left was the small section of wall that Dirk barely fit behind. Upon passing, the blades cut into the field and released a small pressurized explosion, kicking up mud. Dirk was still a stone for a second. Shit. He cursed at the sharpness of those water blades. The next second, he dashed out from behind the wall. Luckily, even after creating the wall he moved his body out of the trajectory of the blades. He never fully trusted his magic against this strong enemy, and that had saved his life. Only, he was worried about Ava, who got the same attack. After running out, he looked over. 
to this attack, Ava wasn't able to conjure a strong wall like Dirk, something that wasn't effective anyway. So instead of hiding, she had formed balls of water, pressurizing them before sending them out at the six blades of water. After colliding, the balls of water exploded. This destabilized the structure of the water blades, making them lose form and release their pressure. The result was six explosions in the air and a successful defense. Only, this defensive attack had come at great cost to Ava's energy. She felt a small but sharp pain in her head, a result of pressurizing the water balls so much. In a short amount of time, she couldn't launch very many of those attacks before exhausting all her energy. And this was even after her advancement. But she was at least okay. After recovering from the retaliation, the two went back to kiting the king. Dirk consistently threw out his own arrows while Ava threw out blades a bit less often. Both of them tore open holes that weakened the king. Only, they hoped it weakened the king. The battle went on for an hour, but even after so many attacks, the king didn't falter. It never even moved, just sitting there and throwing out attacks while repairing any damage it took. There was no indication as to how much energy it had. It never made pain noises, shook, or anything. There were no hints as to its status. This distressed both the challengers, but they could only keep going. After one hour was two, and yet the attacks of the king never let up. In fact, it would occasionally launch barges of water balls or blades, forcing Dirk and Ava to expend lots of their energy. Like this, their mental energy was gradually depleted. Luckily they at least had their seemingly endless physical stamina. But that alone wouldn't keep them alive forever. As they approached the third hour, Dirk started thinking of different plans. He knew they were bleeding energy from the king, but he didn't know how much. If they couldn't harm it before they collapsed, then they would be done for. So he planned out a way to cause deeper wounds without burning too much energy. Ava! To me! Suddenly, Dirk shouted. Ava was quick to run to his side, the two defending against attacks together. It's risky, but we need to heavily wound it. One big attack, and hopefully that will at least tell us how strong the king still is. All right. But we'll need to recover for a while after that. That's fine. We'll disperse afterward and spend time recovering. For now, just worry about this attack. We're going to combo your blades and my arrows, getting as deep as possible. Form two of your strongest blades while still being able to run and dodge, and I'll take care of the rest. On your mark, we'll attack. I'll be right behind you. Okay. Ava nodded. With that, the two dodged an attack before Ava raised her hand. After a couple seconds, two water blades appeared above her head. The blades were a foot long about half the size of normal, and their power was extremely condensed. After forming these blades, Ava felt another sharp pain in her head, but she pushed through, approaching the king. I'll give you an opening. Suddenly, Dirk jumped forward. The king attacked him, throwing out four balls of water. To this, Dirk formed and launched four arrows. The attacks cancelled each other. After that, Ava took the chance. Running forward, she swung her arm, and the blades went flying. The first blade instantly cut through the king's body, creating a large parting. And before water could explode out, the second blade came, cutting even deeper. The two blades combined opened up the king's body until there was barely a foot-wide barrier of water between open air and the core. Naturally, Dirk didn't let this chance go. Before the second blade even hit, he was already behind the attacks with his own rock arrows. As soon as the king was open, he threw down six of his own rock arrows. However, at the same time that he threw the arrows, the king attacked with a water ball. Dirk disregarded the attack, pushing forth and releasing his own. When his arrows were gone, he raised his arm, and a layer of metallic rock covered it. The ball crashed into him, the explosion sending him flying. At the same time though, the arrows rained down upon the core. One after the other, the arrow tips chipped the core. The first one barely scratched the surface, and the second one only created a small opening before bouncing away. But the third and fourth ones opened up a crack. 
the last two open up the crack further, causing water mana to spill out. After that, the arrows were blasted away as water came exploding out of the large gouge. Dirk! After watching the successful attack, Ava flipped around to Dirk. After getting hit by the water ball, he had been thrown away, tumbling on the ground before coming to a stop. Only, Dirk was never one to be hindered by pain. After gaining control of himself, he immediately jumped to his feet despite the throbbing pain in his arm. The piece of armor he had raised to block the water ball was totally shattered, and now his entire arm was paralyzed as the muscles spasmed in pain. Dirk grit his teeth as he turned his head to the king. After the attacks landed, the king's body immediately shrunk by a small amount. Still, it was noticeable, and they had done damage. That's all Dirk wanted. For a while, the water within the king continued to spray out and soak the already wet ground. Seeing this, Dirk decided to throw out more attacks. He was in a better position than Ava to do so with more energy to spare. Raising his arm, Dirk conjured five more arrows, immediately throwing them all out. The king responded and threw out three water balls, blowing away three of the arrows. But two arrows still landed, puncturing the water body even more. Dirk was happy as the king was further injured. With that crack in the core, it would continue weakening over time. Now Dirk and Ava just had to survive. However, as if the king knew this, it suddenly changed tactics. Right after the arrows punched into its body, six water balls shot out of it. Dirk saw this, and his pupils contracted. All six shot toward him. Damn! He cursed, running away. The six water balls followed behind him, rapidly gaining ground. Boom! Suddenly, one of the balls made contact with Dirk, exploding. His body was thrown across the field, tumbling a few times. Using this momentum though, Dirk staggered to his feet and continued running. Right after though, another water ball flew at him. He barely brought up a plate of metallic rock armor on his back before it exploded. Boom! Dirk was sent flying again. Right after hitting the ground though, he jumped back up to his feet, the rock armor on his back shattered. Again. Boom. Right after, yet another ball exploded behind him. Dirk did the same and created armor, but it was also shattered. This time though, as Dirk recovered, he turned around and created a wall. One of the balls exploded on it, directly shattering it. However, as the next ones came flying through the debris, they were met with arrows that took them out. With that, Dirk took a deep breath, looking at the king. His entire body now throbbed in pain, the armor not doing much to mitigate the shockwaves. He felt a bit of blood seep into his mouth from how rattled his body was, but he ignored it as his nanites went to work. The king's body continued to gradually shrink. Not long after sending out those balls, the hole started to seal up. But even with its body intact, its core was irreversibly damaged. It would still weaken over time. Damage to its body would just accelerate the process. Dirk knew this, so when the king sent out another five water balls, he braced himself. He just needed to outlast the king and keep it off of Ava. However, it was at that moment that Ava suddenly struck. With two water blades, she cut open the distracted king, causing more water to explode out. Dirk looked over and saw her gritting her teeth in obvious agony. Hey! Don't attract its attention. Just recover. No! I'm helping. Ava shouted back, forcing herself to create another water blade. She launched one quickly, creating another gouge. After that, the king sent out two water balls toward her. With a splitting headache, Ava turned and ran, grabbing her axe for the first time. Right as the water balls got close, she swung around. The blade of her axe split open one of the balls. The resulting explosion threw the axe out of her grip, sending it across the field. Then, the second ball came hurtling toward her. At that time though, a wall was suddenly erected in front of her. The wall blocked the ball, breaking under its subsequent explosion. After that, Dirk came running over. Can you move? He spoke as he turned around, sending out arrows to some more incoming attacks. 
Through her dizziness and pain, Ava nodded. Yes. All right, no more magic. Just run with me. Stick to defense, and I'll try to poke some more holes in it. But you've already used so many rock arrows. It's fine. I've got a bit more in me. Dirk reassured her. Not unlike her, after getting tossed around and having to conjure so many walls and arrows, he also had a stabbing headache. But his pain tolerance was higher. Even with this headache, he still maintained his physical function. Hearing him, Ava could only agree. Any more magic and she would pass out, and then she would be dead weight to Dirk. Mustering up all her willpower, she began to run again, Dirk right behind. Over the next several minutes, the two dodged and blocked attacks together. The king continued to be aggressive, using its dwindling power to try and kill its enemies before it gave in to death. Because of this, the pressure on Dirk and Ava only increased. And while Dirk knew that more pressure meant the battle would end faster, he was worried about the damage they would receive trying to defend. Because of that, he started to use everything at his disposal. By now, Dirk's earth mana heart was almost depleted. He had been pulling in mana gradually from his surroundings to supplement his magic. One thing he came to discover from this was that his mental energy surpassed the size of his mana pool, meaning before his energy ran out, he would deplete his mana pool. This happened during the battle, requiring him to use mana lungs in order to pull more mana in. But now, he was summoning the last dregs of his pool. With each attack of the king, Dirk was forced to throw an arrow or raise a wall, and his soul was quickly depleted. This was an incredibly uncomfortable feeling, but he had no choice. But this extreme depletion caused something within him to bloom. As exhaustion set in for both Dirk and Ava, the king began to let out its final attacks. Its body had already shrunk to half its size, and with this attack, even more of its energy was depleted. It wouldn't live after much more. Only, this attack consisted of four water balls, not water blades that took more energy to conjure. Dirk and Ava, who were on the edges of the field, watched as this attack flew toward them. I got two. As Dirk struggled to muster any mana, Ava stepped forward. Raising both her arms, her eyes went bloodshot as her fingers streaked across space. Two water blades were created. And with extreme fatigue threatening to put her to sleep, Ava pushed them forward, sending them flying toward two of the water balls. The attacks collided midway, an explosion of water causing a mist to drift in the surroundings. Now, there were only two water balls left. Dirk also grit his teeth. He stood and tried to form a spell, but there was barely any mana to use. He was totally dry, not even able to form a rock arrow. But this wasn't acceptable. With wide eyes, Dirk glared at the oncoming water balls. Then, he activated mana lungs, his one technique that could recover mana. Huh. With a deep breath, Dirk felt his soul surge with a small burst of power. The power of his mana lungs spread throughout the field, turning into a pit that all earth mana fell into. For a second, Dirk teetered on the verge of passing out. Mana lungs still took a small amount of energy to use and he no longer had any more energy. However, with that small burst of power he felt, Dirk felt something inside and change. With no energy left, there was only one way to engage the technique, with his very soul that wasn't bound by any concepts of energy. Like this, his soul became responsible for utilizing mana lungs. And with this came a small transformation. Attention, skill acquisition successful. Dirk Strider has earned the skill, Mana Lungs, Grade 5. Profile Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, 3. Rank, 3. Plus. Attributes, Fire, 71%, Lightning, 89%, Earth, 88%, Metal, 93%, Dark, 92%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7, Mana Resonance, Grade 5, Mana Lungs, Grade 5. Dirk was suddenly prompted with messages, but he had no attention to spare. After the skill was acquired and its effects kicked in, Dirk felt any earth mana in the vicinity flood toward him, 
giving him a small supply. After that, he instantly cast his spell. Perhaps because of his skill acquisition, Dirk was able to muster up just enough energy to facilitate the cast. With a wave of the hand, two walls were formed in front of him and Ava. These walls were only made of the dirt in the ground and filled with his mana to reinforce them. They were flimsier, but they did the job. One after the other, the two remaining water balls exploded on the two walls. With that, the attacks were over. Dirk maintained consciousness as he watched the king. It actually sent out another water ball, but this merely hit the ground before it could reach them. The king then proceeded to lose the last of its bodily form, water flooding outward, unable to be contained. The core settled on the ground, that single crack in it draining the last bit of power. Seeing this, Dirk looked at Ava who was kneeling before bending down and grabbing her arm. She was barely conscious, and supporting each other, they trudged over to the core. At the same time, they saw the confirmation of their victory. Congratulations! The elemental king of water has been eliminated. Your reward has been decreed. The king's hall will reset in twenty hours. Chapter 76 Scared after the system prompts appeared, Dirk and Ava saw an altar rise from the ground. It was just like last time, the same white marble altar with exquisite engravings and two golden bowls. Dirk and Ava walked over to the bowls, their steps labored and each one taking significant physical and mental effort. Another ring would be nice, one for you. Then we can both carry things. Dirk mumbled as they walked, his body working in overdrive to heal him. Ava let out a small smile through the horrible pain in her head. She wasn't actually sure if she cared about the rewards. She only wanted to pass out. She was even starting to feel nauseous. The two looked at each bowl. In the left bowl, there was a single ring. Dirk recognized it rather quickly. It was another pocket ring formed of black metal. He grabbed it and put it in Ava's hand. Are you sure? Yes. It's better if it's with you. I think it's your reward anyway. Really? Ava was confused. Suddenly, the two looked over at the other bowl. Inside the right bowl, the two could see small violet sparks fly about. These sparks jumped out of a single marble in the center of the bowl. A mana crystal? No, I think it's a pill. Ava chimed in as she looked at the marble. It looked similar to a mana crystal but there were differences that she noticed. I learned about these in alchemy class. Instead of liquid concoctions, you can make high concentration pills that can later be diffused into a liquid and absorbed. I've never actually made one, but this definitely looks like a pill. Oh. So it's a lightning pill. But these rewards are supposed to be tailored to us. Do you have the lightning specialization? Ava looked up at Dirk. Seeing him nod, she was a bit surprised. She knew he had the metal specialization for his earth attribute, but now it turned out he could wield lightning. To think he actually had two specializations. I haven't developed my fire magic yet, so I've never wielded any lightning spells. These rewards are rather lucky. I happen to need lightning stuff right now, and we needed another pocket ring for you. Very nice. Dirk nodded approvingly as he took the lightning pill. After throwing it into his ring, he looked over at where the king was. As they hunted throughout the dungeon, Dirk and Ava hadn't taken any of the elemental cores because they were way too big. But the core of the king was much stronger than normal. Not only that, it was mostly intact. Dirk assumed it would sell for a good sum of money. The only problem was that the mana crystal was still inside of the core. Ava thought for a second as they approached the core. Hey, let's just take the whole thing for now. I'll put it in my ring. Maybe we can sell both at the academy. That works for me. Dirk readily agreed. He didn't exactly feel like putting in the effort to break the core open right now. As Ava bent down, she placed her hand over the core. The next moment, it disappeared into the pocket ring. It wasn't hard for anyone to learn how to operate a ring. With that, Dirk and Ava retrieved what they came to this dungeon for. However, they didn't leave the king's chambers right away. 
Dirk knew that both of them were very weak, and he wasn't comfortable with presenting himself in front of people. If anyone got any unsavory ideas, he would have a hard time protecting himself and Ava. Let's go rest for a bit. Dirk spoke softly before walking with Ava to one of the walls of the chambers. After taking out some blankets, he laid them on some soft but dry mud. After laying down a pillow, he helped Ava lay down. Can we stay here? As long as those doors don't open, nobody will know that we're done. Go ahead and go to sleep. What about you? You need rest too. I guess I can also sleep. After thinking for a second, Dirk let out a light breath and laid down as well. Ava smiled before getting comfortable. The two didn't speak anymore, just letting themselves succumb to their deep fatigue. Only, before Dirk fell asleep, he gave an order to his AI. Alert me of any movement and wake me in sixteen hours. Affirmative. With that, Dirk closed his eyes. His breath became shallow as his heart rate slowed. At the same time, the mana in the vicinity would be pulled into Dirk's lungs with every inhale and pushed out with every exhale. This was his new mana lung skill at work, working passively even when he went unconscious. Beep beep beep. Mm. As he slept soundly, Dirk was awoken by the familiar sound of an alarm. This sound was reassuring, letting Dirk know that there was no danger or movement to be worried about. Upon waking, he slightly smiled. His mind felt clear and sharp, and his mana pool had already regenerated to max capacity. His body was also healed up well, only some small internal wounds lingering. Those water balls he was thrown around by hit hard, but with his new Earth Guard spell, he was able to mitigate a lot of the damage. He was glad he picked the spell. Looking over, Dirk saw that Ava was still sleeping. At some point she had tossed around as well and ended up sprawled out across the blankets, her arm and leg over Dirk's body. He pushed her limbs off of him before standing. He looked at the door to the king's chambers. Since the king was always being fought by someone, Dirk had figured that someone would come down and check on their status, thus trying to open the doors. But it looked like nobody could just enter as they pleased. This was good information that pleased him. In the future, they could recover safely after any king battles by just sticking within the chambers. Now that Dirk was recovered, he wasn't worried about leaving. Even if someone wanted to try and rob them, they would have to kill him in order to do that, which would not be easy with his strength. After gazing at the doors, he looked back at Ava. Since she was still sleeping, he decided to let her wake naturally. That would ensure the best recovery. However, there were only another three hours left before the King's Hall reset. Dirk didn't know what would happen, but he didn't want to be here when it did. Luckily, Ava woke after only two more hours. After spending around ten minutes waking up, the two packed everything and went to leave. Together, they pushed open the doors to the hall. They then walked down the hall and picked up the cores that had been left behind from the other elementals. Since Ava had a pocket ring now, they could carry more items. The cores of low tier fours were valuable. After that, the two walked through the black dungeon portal, emerging back within the main dungeon. It was here though that they were greeted with the sight of a small crowd. Seeing so many people in front of him, Dirk traced his knife sheath with his fingertips. It's you! So you two are alive. That's rather amazing. Suddenly, a familiar voice rang out. The mage that greeted them before came walking over. Good job defeating the king. He's tough, huh? We've had more experienced groups larger than three come in and still get killed. I guess you two are stronger than you look. There is a bit over an hour left on the reset. We'll be leaving now. After listening to the mage, Dirk spoke straightforwardly. After that, he beckoned Ava over. She smiled wryly before waving at the mage, following Dirk. Seeing that, the mage didn't push anything and just waved back. After that, the next group up to fight began the wait. Dirk didn't waste any time leaving the haven and entering the wider dungeon. It was here that he and Ava increased their speed, bounding through the dark and humid forest. In only four hours they crossed the entire dungeon, passing the still-crowded haven by the entrance. Walking past the crowd, 
Dirk and Ava left the dungeon, stepping through the portal. After emerging, they were greeted with a dark night sky and eerily quiet town. Hopefully we can leave by tomorrow morning. And hopefully we can get back home safely. Dirk mumbled as he started walking in a certain direction. Ava frowned as she heard him. She didn't forget their multiple encounters with bandits and how there was something going on in the dark that concerned them, or more specifically Dirk. Her mood was dampened as they made their way to a building. This was one of the few buildings with lights still on. After entering, they were greeted with the sight of a counter and a man sleeping behind it. Excuse me. Huh. After Dirk approached and spoke with a loud tone, the man was awoken. He frowned as he rubbed his eyes, looking at Dirk and Ava. What do you want? A ride to the capital city. Tomorrow morning. H.M. Letting out a breath, the man grabbed a large book and started flipping through some pages with lists written on it. After a few minutes, he saw something. You're in luck. There's a small caravan heading out in three hours just before dawn. Only, it's a bit more expensive. For you too, it'll be sixty gold. Done. With a word, Dirk grabbed a bag out of his pocket ring before pouring out some gold coins on the counter. The man quickly counted before scooping the coins and handing the two a ticket. Dirk had taken a supply of gold with him on this trip so paying for this wasn't difficult. With that, the two left the building and sat against the wall of another, waiting for the three hours to pass. Then, just before the sun began to peak above the horizon, a small group of people walked into the parking area where all the caravans were located. Seeing this, Dirk stood with Ava and walked over. Finding the head merchant, Dirk verified that it was the right caravan. After handing over the ticket, he and Ava jumped into the back of a wagon. This caravan only had two wagons, and alongside the head merchant were two workers. The two workers drove the two wagons while the head merchant rode in the first wagon. After the duo were settled in the second wagon, the caravan was quick to take off. The two wagons drove off onto a road, making their way back to the capital city. And perhaps because this was a small caravan, the wagons moved quite a bit faster. Dirk was notified just before leaving that the trip would only take two days instead of three. This made him happy and he and Ava got comfortable with some blankets. Meanwhile, as this caravan made its way out of the town, a pair of eyes watched them from atop a building. So he's caught on. Smart. I guess now is the time that I report back. Have fun, you unlucky child. There won't be much more of this soon enough. He he he. With a sinister laugh, the person behind that pair of eyes disappeared into the darkness. The direction they headed wasn't in Dirks, but off into the forest around the town. The two-day drive back to the capital city passed uneventfully. Dirk and Ava were prepared for something to happen for the entire ride, but when they came to approach the capital city walls, Dirk was surprised. However, he wasn't very happy about this lack of disturbance. He only thought that something else was going on, and he didn't let his guard down. After getting back to the city, the two made their way back to the academy. However, upon arriving at the academy gates, Dirk stopped walking. Ava turned around, looking at him confusedly. Dirk? What's wrong? She asked as she walked back over to him. During the ride, he hadn't been relaxed or happy, sporting a mean look the entire time. This wasn't due to the potential danger, but because he was deliberating something internally. Dirk stood there silently for a while, staring off into space. Finally, as if he made a decision, he sighed. Let's go. He spoke before walking. Ava could only follow, and they made their way deep into the academy. Surprisingly, they didn't make their way home or to turn in their job. Instead, Dirk walked straight to his father's house. It was the middle of the night when they arrived at the city, so when Dirk knocked on the door to his father's residence, he wasn't immediately answered. It took a while for Riker himself to show up at the door, and when he saw his son dressed in full armor, he was surprised. Dirk? So you've returned. How was your job? Fine. I need to talk to you and mother. Oh? Riker's eyebrows raised, sensing the urgency in Dirk's tone. 
Without questions, he brought his son and Ava inside, locking the door behind him. Cecilia, come down here. As Riker took his son to the kitchen, he called out to his wife. In a few moments, Dirk saw his mother appear in light clothing, something she obviously momentarily threw on. With the moonlight beaming through the windows and Cecilia's slim by proportion body, she looked exceptionally beautiful, worthy of being the wife of a Marquis just by her looks. But Dirk didn't care about this. He looked at his mother, conflict written on his face. Cecilia could sense her son's tension as she entered the kitchen. Without words, everyone sat down at the table. What's on your mind, son? Cecilia gently asked as they sat there. Dirk was silent for a while before raising his head. I have a problem, but I'm not sure if it's something you can help me with. And I hope what I tell you doesn't upset you. Dirk spoke hesitantly. Hearing his unease, both his parents were a bit shocked. This was the first time Dirk had ever expressed any sort of worry over their reaction or approval. And Dirk truly was worried. He was planning to expose what he had done recently, and he didn't want them to think that he was some abnormal freak. For the first time in his life, he found himself concerned over their view of him. He was scared. Whatever it is, Dirk, you're safe to speak it here. There's nothing you can say that will change our love for you. Cecilia assured her son with careful words. Dirk lightly nodded to this before taking a small breath. During the job I took before this recent one with Alec, Ava and I had a confrontation with three robbers who sought to hurt us. I killed all three of them. I was told by the last robber I killed that they had been hired by someone to attack us. Dirk directly spoke, his words clear for everyone to hear. Ava felt a small chill come over her as she recounted those events, and Dirk's parents were stunned silent. Dirk continued after a moment. After Ava and I completed the job alone, we returned, and I was both distracted and unwilling to speak of this event. However, we encountered more of these happenings on the recent trip. The ride to the designated down was three days long. In the middle of the first night, the caravan was ambushed by a group of bandits. I killed seven of these bandits. After that, the caravan continued, but in the middle of the third day, we were attacked again by a large group of a couple dozen bandits. To defend the caravan, I killed eleven. However, I also took a bandit hostage. In private, I asked this bandit if they had been hired to attack the caravan. The bandit spoke of a mysterious man who had spoken to their leader only the night before, one he had never seen. I tried to get more information, but before I could, an invisible figure killed the bandit right in front of me from a distance. I was only able to spot a small fluctuation in dark mana that indicated someone was there, but this invisible person's skills were beyond mine and I couldn't track them. After that, nothing else happened, and Ava and I were able to complete our job and return here with no more conflicts. Everyone was silent as Dirk finished. Ava clenched her fists under the table, all the things Dirk spoke of playing back in her mind. Meanwhile, Cecilia's face was pale, and Riker had an ugly frown. Nobody spoke for a while. In Dirk's mind though, this silence was deafening. He had a bad feeling well up within him, and he became a bit fearful. Dirk had deliberated greatly on whether or not he would bring this up. Sure he was worried about who was trying to hurt him, but at the same time, he wasn't sure how he would ask for help. What could his parents do? For all he knew, this was coincidental, and there was nothing they could do. And now, he had also told his parents that he had ended 21 lives. Would they think he was some sort of monster? In this world of sword and magic, that was unlikely, but Dirk still had this irrational fear within him. He had come to like his parents. They were nice and caring, both giving him freedom and watching out for his well-being. Dirk didn't want them to think anything that would distance them from him. To him, telling of everything that had happened was a big risk. Dirk didn't know what he would do if they became disapproving or distant. But he had taken the leap anyway. His instincts told him that this issue was bigger than it seemed, and in this world of massive power gaps, Dirk didn't have anything else to fall back on. There were people Dirk couldn't defend himself against, and for the first time ever, he was putting his safety in someone else's hands. He both hated and loved this fact, 
because he didn't have the power to defend himself, and yet he had someone he could trust and rely on. Dirk didn't speak any further, but with each passing second, he became more and more anxious. Finally, his mother stood from her seat, walking over, and wrapping him in a tight hug. Chapter 77, Clutches Dirk's body went stiff as his mother embraced him. I'm so sorry, my baby. Everything's going to be okay. You have nothing to worry about. You're not in the wrong here. Cecilia's voice was emotional as she tightened her grip on Dirk. Feeling her warm hug and reassuring words, Dirk felt a huge weight lifted off his shoulders. He found himself smiling with a bit of emotion as he hugged her back. To him, this was one of his happiest moments in a while. Despite the things he had done at such a young age, his mother didn't resent him. This was the greatest confirmation of trust that he had ever received. Suddenly, with a worried face, Cecilia pulled back, looking at Dirk's body. She could see his armor that was now obviously damaged from the battles he had been in. Are you hurt anywhere? Do you need healing? No, I'm okay. That's good. What about you, Ava? I am okay. Ava waved in reassurance. Cecilia nodded at this, but the next moment, she moved over to Ava, giving her a hug as well. Ava was surprised and a bit confused until Cecilia spoke gently. No matter what, you were there with my son. I'm sure it was scary, having to go through all that. Why yeah? Ava choked up a bit. Each time Dirk had to go out and kill bandits, she had been filled with fear and anger. She was scared that she would be faced with a threat to her life, and in those moments she just wanted to curl up in a hole and hide. But this was also why she was angry at herself. While Dirk had made her promise to let him handle everything, she still felt hateful of her weakness. All those emotions had been bottled up though, sealed away while she trudged forth and continued following Dirk. In exchange for having him handle everything, she forced herself to at least keep up with him. She wouldn't allow herself to fall behind. That would truly make her weak. But those emotions still placed a weight on her heart. Now, as Cecilia poked right at those emotions, she felt herself break down. Toward Dirk's mother, she felt great security and tenderness. Cecilia held Ava as she started to silently cry, letting out the great toll those bottled emotions had taken on her mind. Meanwhile, Riker stood up, walking over and placing his hand on Dirk's shoulder. He spoke. I know it's not something you may be proud of or happy to have done, but you still did well. I'm only sorry that you've been faced with such a thing at your age. No child should have to bear the burden of death before they've come to understand what it means. Your brother Ethan who is almost twenty years old and has already entered the military is only just beginning to understand what it means to take a life. I'm proud that you were able to get yourself through it. Both of you. Riker looked between Ava and Dirk. He was proud of his son for being able to step up to the danger and not only preserve his life, but help others. While it was indeed a bit odd that Dirk had been so untroubled about it, not showing any sign of distress when he had come back after the first incident, that didn't matter to Riker. All he cared about was his son's safety and well-being. And he was also proud of Ava. While she apparently didn't take any lives, Riker could guess that she wasn't allowed to. His son had stepped up in her stead, likely wanting to protect her from it. He was fine with this. But he was happy that Ava had stuck with Dirk through it all, not cowering away and detaching herself from him. Ava nodded to Riker as she gradually stopped crying in Cecilia's arms. She was feeling a lot better hearing his words. Only, she still hated how Dirk was the only one to bear that burden. It was why she had come to start tending to him more often on their trip. She cared for him and didn't want him to be traumatized by what he had to do. After a bit of silence, Cecilia frowned before taking a deep breath. Dirk, and you too Ava. I want you to stay in the academy for a while. That means don't leave the walls of this place. Just continue studying here and improving for a while. And take this. Suddenly, Cecilia brought something out of a pocket ring, handing it to Dirk. He grabbed the object that was a necklace with a black marble hanging on it. That is a warning beacon. 
it maintains a connection to a beacon I carry with me. If you crush that marble, I'll know that something is wrong and come to you wherever you are. From now on, always keep this on you. Okay? Cecilia looked into Dirk's eyes, her tone serious. Dirk felt the marble as he nodded with a frown. Now, he was really concerned about what was going on. With his temporary grounding to the academy walls, he could only assume that he was still in danger even within the academy, enough to where his mother had to give him this. After that, Cecilia didn't talk much more about the topic of Dirk's encounters, and he didn't ask. After he gave a little recounting of his time in the dungeon, he left with Ava to go back home. The two would wait until the next day to turn in their job. Riker saw the two off, watching as they left the residence together. Then, after closing the doors, he went back to his wife who was still in the kitchen. Cecilia had a pale face, and her hands trembled. He. He wants to take my baby away from me. She mumbled, her lips quivering. The next moment, her face contorted in rage. That bastard. He wants to take my baby away from me. Bang. Cecilia brought down her arms. The table under her exploded into splinters, chunks of wood flying out everywhere. Some of the wood even disintegrated under her power of darkness. Damn him. I was supposed to be out. I got away from him. It's been decades. And now he's going after my child. I'm going to kill every last one of those fucking Azuras. I'm going to get every last one of them alive. Cecilia. As the power of darkness crept up around Cecilia's body, Riker suddenly stepped in, grabbing her shoulders. It's okay. We can dash. No. It's not okay. Swinging her arms, Cecilia broke Riker's grip. Do you not realize? This situation is almost hopeless. He's coming after Dirk. I know. And are we ready for this? I'm a tier 7, and Hillshire is on our side, a tier 8. We can protect Dirk. Okay, and how are we going to do that? We can't keep Dirk in the academy for the rest of his life. He needs to grow, fighting in dungeons. He needs to meet people, and make friends, and be a normal person. But if we do that, then he'll be taken. He's already been evaluated. Those attacks are meant to measure his talent. And he's passed. Do you understand what it means for that bastard to go after him? That means that there is nothing that is preventing him from doing so. Sooner or later, he's. Dirk's going to get taken. Getting to this point, Cecilia turned even paler. She fell to her knees, her fingers clutching her hair. My baby is going to be taken. Cecilia. He trusts me. But I can't protect him. I. I don't want my baby to be taken. Her entire body trembled on the floor, tears streaming from her eyes. Riker knelt down, wrapping his wife up in a hug. No, don't say that. We're going to protect our son. I'll talk to Hillshire. We'll use everything at our disposal. We can even go on the offensive and find them first. We can take care of the problem before it strikes. Cecilia was silent as Riker spoke, her hands gripping his clothes. The more he said, the tighter her grip became. Riker grit his teeth. He knew what she was thinking. It was useless. And he also knew deep down that this was the case. He didn't know as much as his wife, but he was very familiar with the people behind this. They were the darkness of his wife's past, and not even the Empire could get rid of them completely. This was due to the man behind them. A single man who operated in the shadows of the Empire, and one who had once stood over his wife's shoulders like some kind of evil god. Back then, she had escaped him and his clutches. But now, this darkness was surfacing once more, and it was prepared to claim a sacrifice. We'll. We'll get through it. We all will. Riker could only speak these words. For a while, he held his wife as she cried, her grabbing his clothes as if trying to hold on to hope. That night, Dirk and Ava went to his house. They were both in a better mood, but Dirk couldn't help but feel as if something was watching him. He could sense something in the darkness. 
his intuition told him that things were not okay. And it wasn't often that Dirk doubted his intuition. His gut had gotten him through his life on earth, a life of constant battle and extreme danger. So he trusted his judgment greatly. The fact that there were alarms going off in his head was discomforting. But there wasn't much he could do. By telling his mother of his problems, he was entrusting them to her in a way. She wanted him to stay in the academy now, and he would listen to her. And with the warning beacon she gave him, he felt somewhat secure. With that, he could only wait and see how things would develop. After arriving at his house with Ava, the two stripped their armor before cleaning up. After making a late-night dinner, they both went to bed, Ava following Dirk to his. Like that, they cuddled until they fell asleep. Come next morning, the two woke up late and went together to turn in their job. At the mission building, they pulled out the job paper and the elemental king's core with the mana crystal still inside. The receptionist was surprised before accepting everything and paying them out. For the job to retrieve the king's mana crystal, they were paid 330 gold coins. With the high-quality core on top of that, the two came out with about 430 gold. This surprised both Dirk and Ava, and they happily took the money. They walked out of the mission building with smiling faces. Let's see, we got 500 gold from that merchant as thanks for saving him, and now 430 gold from this job. After the 100 or so gold we spent for the ride back in food, we've profited over 800 gold. That's rather amazing for a less than two week long trip. Ava skipped happily as she made these deductions in her head. Dirk couldn't help but bob his head. The Academy really did pay handsomely. This was one of the other reasons why the Academy was so popular. It obviously commanded a vast amount of wealth, and it made sure to pay its students nicely for completing jobs. By doing this, students would be able to effectively grow into a force for the Empire. Over many years, the amount of competent and powerful mages that had been and would be created by the Academy was too many to count. And the Academy had no problem doing this either. Its student body wasn't any more than 1,500. No matter how many jobs students completed or how much higher than market price the Academy paid them for their services, they wouldn't run out of money. Sure it came out to cost them a great sum of wealth but in exchange, they strengthened the empire with hundreds and thousands of mages and warriors. Without the academy, the empire wouldn't be the force that it was. After enjoying the sound of clanking gold and the feeling of heavy money bags, Dirk and Ava decided to spend their day relaxing. Since they were now confined to the academy walls, they couldn't go and eat at a restaurant or tour the beautiful capital city. While the academy did indeed have its own restaurants, Dirk and Ava decided to wait until night to go to one. Thus, they spent most of their day just sitting around the house. They would lay across the couch, snuggle a bit, cook some food they had never tried before, almost set the house on fire, and then go back to lazing around. This lasted until the sun started to set. At that time, the duo made their way to the nicest restaurant in the academy. They tried to get a seat on the highest floor but as the quality of this place was far higher than the place in some random dungeon town, they were limited to one of the middle floors. Still, the place had a nice view of not only the sunset, but the magic pyramid that glowed with enchanted lights. Finally, when the two went to pick out food to eat, they gawked. Some of the food on the menu cost hundreds of gold for a single serving. Looking at it, they saw that these foods were made of meat from Tier 5 monsters. Dirk and Ava had never even seen a Tier 5 monster, let alone eat one. Unfortunately, neither of them were willing to spend so much money on food. Thus, they ordered some delicacies made from Tier 4 monsters. They even specified which elemental type they wanted. Their total bill was around 140 gold, causing Dirk to curse at how easily money could be spent. When the food came out though, both of them felt their mouths water. The servings were large, and the aroma was heavenly. Sticking a piece of meat into their mouths, they shuddered at the magnificent flavor. Oh my god, I have never tasted something so, good. Ava's eyes seemed to roll back as she savored the flavor. Dirk wasn't much better than her. His eyes were closed, focusing only on the intense flavor of the meat. 
the meat he ordered was from a tier 4 fire monster. Thus, the food was filled with fire mana. Upon swallowing the first bite, Dirk could feel a warmth spread through his body. Fire mana was absorbed by his stomach, injected into his body where it entered his blood. Feeling this, Dirk focused on his mana lungs. By now, he had noticed that breathing mana was not only effortless but natural due to his skill acquisition. If he didn't actively stop it, his body just absorbed mana on its own, constantly filling and draining his lungs of mana. While this didn't allow Dirk to passively accumulate mana and form something like his mana heart automatically, it did fill his blood with increasingly high concentrations of mana. Dirk felt like he was constantly full of mana, giving him feelings of comfort. And if he ever wanted to, he could draw on all this mana to concentrate it and form the mana heart like he needed to. And right now, as Dirk focused on his mana lungs, he found that it was bringing in large concentrations of fire mana from the food he ate. After pulling some of the fire mana from his lungs, he focused it in his chest, right next to his heart. Faintly, a red orb congealed. This orb was located within his heart at the bottom left corner, almost right next to his earth mana heart. According to his mana heart technique, he would form a triad of mana hearts right next to each other in a triangle formation. The earth heart was the tip of the triangle and was located slightly higher than the center of his heat. Now, he would form the fire mana heart that was the left corner of the triangle. His dark mana heart would be the right corner. All three mana hearts were within the physical heart, and together, they would all saturate the blood with mana. As Dirk moved the fire mana within him to form the next mana heart, he could feel the fire mana diffuse into his blood. This made it more difficult to form the heart, but only temporarily until the blood got its fill. After a while, Dirk would find forming his mana heart much easier. Like this, he sat and ate at the dinner table while cultivating. A warm feeling spread through his veins, making the dinner all the more enjoyable. As he ate more, more fire mana was made available to him. While it wasn't high in quantity, Dirk found it to be high in density, making the absorption process easier. After a while, Dirk and Ava finished eating the last bites on their plate. They both sat back against their chairs, their bellies full. Ah. Hey, why can't we cook stuff like this? Ava raised her head and looked at Dirk. He also raised his head and thought for a second. Because. We have to kill tier 4 monsters. I think that will be my reason to get stronger for a while. Agreed. Ask the waiter for water. If I eat or drink any more I'm gonna puke. Ava shook her head as she reclined further into her seat. The food was so good that she ate more than what she should have been capable of. She couldn't even move. Dirk let out a breath before laying back too. They waited for about half an hour like that as their food digested. After finally recovering enough to move, the two went home for the night. The next day, their classes would start back up, and for the foreseeable future they would be practicing magic. Dirk also planned to continue his destruction cycles. He had neglected them for a while as he had always been fighting, but now that would change. Chapter 78 Runic Formations The next day, Dirk and Ava resumed their school schedule. Because Dirk didn't have any issues with his spells, he didn't go to his classes for help. The only spells he hadn't gotten a hang of were his dark ones, but that was due to him not having his dark mana heart yet. Only Curse of Darkness could even be studied, let alone the other ones that had higher prerequisites. Plus, Dirk didn't know if he wanted to see Geralt in order to get help. So he decided to go back to his forging and enchanting classes. First came the enchanting class. Upon entering, Dirk was silently handed the enchanting book by his teacher. The old man spoke with a small scowl. I understand that developing your spells and fighting monsters in the dungeons is important, but enchanting is a craft that takes time and dedication. You are my only student that has ever missed so much time and study pertaining to this craft. Thus, I give you a challenge, if you will. Catch up with the first half of that book and enchant this item. If you can do so within two weeks, then you can stay in my class. Otherwise, I don't want you here. You have the ability to enchant, but you lack the commitment. 
and if you decide to leave for another job anytime soon, then don't bother coming back. Dirk was silent in front of his irritated teacher. His face sported a mean frown, and his dark eyes bore into the man. With a huff, he snatched the item his teacher wanted him to enchant and walked out of the classroom. He had already scanned the book entirely, so he didn't need to remain in the room to use it. H.M. Overconfident Brat The teacher waved his hand as Dirk exited. Dirk didn't bother as he left the area, his eyes frigid. As for the item, it was another piece of leather. Dirk just threw it into his pocket ring before moving on. After his enchanting class came forging. Dirk entered that room early, meeting his dwarven teacher. Dirk! It's nice to see my most accomplished student again. Tell me, do you plan on leaving for jobs or what not anytime soon? The dwarf asked this question with an expectant gaze. Dirk shook his head, pleased by this teacher's lack of hostility. No. I'm here for the foreseeable future. Good to hear. Since that's the case, I've thought of a curriculum for you. How many hours a day can you devote to forging? H.M., I can comfortably do eight. Eight? That's more than I expected. Very well. I've done a bit of thinking, and I'm interested in squeezing out your natural talent. Thus, I'm not going to baby you like all those other students who won't go anywhere with forging. I have three classes every day that take up about five hours of my time. I want you to come to forge eight of the Hall of Artisans a few hours before noon from now on. Understood. Good. Let's see if you can live up to my expectations. As for today, I want you to do a bit of studying. Take this book and read through the Theory of Fire section. I know you're a fire mage, and this stuff is especially important for forging. Plus, there's a bit of knowledge in here that goes into more depth than even magic texts. It'll be useful to you even beyond forging. The dwarf flicked his hand, a book appearing from his pocket ring. It was a pristine book built from parchment and a thick scale leather cover. It wasn't huge, but it was by no means small. Dirk took it, feeling the weight in both his hands. Stay here for a few hours, and disregard your classmates during class time. When class ends, you can ask me any questions. I want to make sure you understand certain things before moving on. Understood. Dirk nodded before turning and heading to his desk. Not long after, students started flooding into the classroom. There were less than when the class first started. Dirk opened the book, his head buried in it and disregarding the odd gazes from those around him. Even as the dwarf started yelling instructions, Dirk was zoned out. His AI scanned each page as he flipped through the book. Inside, there was tons of foreign theory. It went through things like hammer techniques, how to channel strength, and how to control the body. There were two important sections though. The first was the fire theory as the dwarf mentioned. This section talked about the different types of fire, temperatures, and how different materials interacted with fire. It even talked about how a fire mage could control their fire directly to conduct their forging. This knowledge went beyond using spells with runes. Instead, it was direct elemental manipulation, touching upon the highest level magical techniques. Dirk eventually tore his eyes away halfway through this section though, flipping through the rest of the book to get an idea of the rest of its contents. Like this, he was quick to find another section. This section was metal theory and the name immediately drew Dirk's attention. This section talked about how an earth mage, preferably one with the metal specialization, could directly control metal to conduct their forging. It provided the same guidance as with fire theory, both touching upon elemental manipulation in order to perform the highest level forging techniques. At a high enough level, there wasn't any such thing as using some shabby metal hammers to mold low-quality metal ingots. The best forge masters used their magic and elements to build the highest quality tools and forge the highest quality metals into works of art. Only elemental manipulation could provide the sheer power and precision necessary to build the best products. This was all extraordinarily valuable knowledge. It described techniques that couldn't be matched even by machines on Earth. It gave Dirk a peek at the highest levels of forging, a world he didn't even know existed. He hadn't thought it was such an in-depth craft. 
Dirk wanted to quickly scan everything. If he could record all the knowledge within this book, he could study it for years to come. However, as he reached the deeper portions of the section, he found something odd. On the deeper pages pertaining to metal theory, each one was filled with complex runic symbols. These were huge runes comprised of hundreds and thousands of mini runes, all brought together to form a runic system. Dirk had barely seen such a thing when forming the runes for his mana heart. Even that rune, one that he had barely comprehended enough to complete, couldn't match the complexity of any rune plastered across the dozens of pages in this book. Flipping back, Dirk found that the second half of the fire theory section was similarly filled with runic pages. Dirk looked at the runes across the first couple runic pages, and when he concentrated, he was surprised to feel the runes pop out at him. He buried his nose deeper into the book, the runes seemingly imparting knowledge to him. As he was engrossed in viewing the runes, Dirk didn't notice his surroundings change. He went from the classroom to an ocean of mana. All around him was a sea of fire, metal, and some lightning. Dirk didn't notice this though as he concentrated on the rune in front of him. The rune within the book, as Dirk had discovered after focusing on it, was filled to the brim with vast knowledge. Runes were the language of magic, and to make them, one had to comprehend the meaning behind them first. Through millennia, mages had come to comprehend their elements, discovering runes that they could use to codify magical knowledge. Thus, runes weren't only used to form spells. They could also be enchanted to things. Not only that, but they could be used to store information. This book utilized that third option. The runes Dirk looked at had all the information behind metal and fire theory. If one could comprehend the entire rune, they would understand the page's contents. Understand all the pages and they would attain all the knowledge within the book. However, one had to comprehend the runes first. This wasn't simply ink on a paper. This was magical text filled with profundity. It contained information that was beyond the written word. Alert! Runic data attempting to be recorded. In order to record non-standard text, your assistance is required in elemental tracing. Suddenly, Dirk heard this alert from his AI. At that moment, he became a bit more lucid. Looking at the rune in front of him, he quickly understood what his AI wanted. Suddenly, around the rune on the page, digital lines began to appear. Dirk's vision began to focus on one of the parts of the huge rune. Then, alongside his AI, he began breaking it down. The digital lines were moved by Dirk to conform to the runes bit by bit, outlining them and then being saved. As he did this, the AI recorded the information down. What they were trying to do could only be described as runic tracing. Dirk couldn't actually comprehend the entire rune. For a bit, he thought that he would need to study the book long term to get anything from it. But with his AI, he discovered that he was actually able to trace the runes, saving them for later. This didn't mean that Dirk or the AI understood the rune. He wouldn't even be able to create the runes with this traced information. It only meant that Dirk could look at it later, going on to comprehend it then. This was the beauty of runes. It codified elemental information, so technically, it could be copied without comprehending it. Such advantages were found in enchanting as well. Enchanted scrolls could be used by mages without understanding the runes on the paper. Enchanted weapons could be used by their handlers without understanding the runes within the enchantments. Despite not understanding the enchantments, mana could still be pushed through them, activating the runes and thus the enchantments or spells. Dirk's AI was now using this same logic. It could record the runes, tracing them and saving them for later. It was almost like the AI was enchanting the runes into itself, thus being able to save it. However, this process of tracing wasn't easy. As Dirk moved the digital lines to encapsulate the rune, he found it become more and more complex. The more precise Dirk tried to make the tracing, the more complex he saw the rune become. It was a cycle of tracing, discovering inaccuracies, correcting them, and discovering even more inaccuracies. This caused Dirk to frown. It was only after a while that he finally traced a rune 100% correctly, but it took a long time, and it was only a tiny portion of the entire page. I can trace runes, but to get 100% accuracy takes time. 
if I want to get all the runes in a timely manner, it'll have to be inaccurate. So the knowledge will be shallow, but at least I'll have something. Dirk came to this conclusion. If he had 100% accuracy, then he would have 100% of the knowledge contained within the rune. But he couldn't copy the runes so precisely in the time he had. So he took a step back, deciding to go for quantity over quality. The entire rune entered Dirk's vision. Then, he saw digital lines appear around all the complex lines of the rune. Dirk's mind was filled with myriads of information. Staring holes into the page, Dirk sifted through the information, correcting the digital tracing of the runes across the board. At the same time, a progress bar appeared displaying the accuracy percentage. The percentage rose quickly at first, going from 0% to 5%, then up to 10% before slowly reaching 20%. It started to rapidly slow after that though as the runes became deeper. After almost half an hour, the accuracy rose to about 25%. It seemed like Dirk had traced a little under a percent a minute, but the last 10% took much longer than the first 10%. In another half an hour, Dirk didn't know if he could get much further past 40%. And in another hour, he might not get past 50%. It became exponentially more complex the deeper he went. The only reason he got to 100% in anything was because it was a single tiny rune, maybe representing a single word and this was only one page. There were dozens of pages filled on each side with these runes, and the deeper one went, the more complex the information became. Dirk was a bit overwhelmed by the profundity. Taking a step back, Dirk sighed. His eyes were a bit bloodshot now. At that moment, there was a knock on his desk. Having a hard time, are we? Huh? Dirk's head snapped upward, seeing his dwarven teacher that stood beside his desk with a smile. The man chuckled. Don't bother attempting to understand those runic pages. Difficult, too difficult. You'll need to be at minimum a tier 5 to start learning such things. Oh. Sorry. No worries. What are you going to do, steal it? You can't even understand it. He, there was a reason I had no problem giving this valuable book to you. In fact, there's a reason places like the Academy and Master Artisans are never worried about lesser-tiered persons stealing any of their high-level books. It's because they can't do anything with it. And if there aren't any runic texts, then the item probably isn't valuable. Dirk nodded understandingly. The next moment though, he froze up a little. Those books that Geralt gave me. They were supposedly spell texts that described tier 6 spells and such. But I didn't see any runic pages in them. Were those really such valuable books? You know what, knowing Geralt, they probably planted fake spell books for him to steal. Maybe I need to talk to him. Dirk scratched his head. No matter what, Geralt had tried to help him with valuable spell knowledge. If Dirk could warn him of the danger, that might save both of them some trouble. Maybe that would ensure that Geralt didn't steal anything anymore since he apparently wasn't as sneaky as he thought he was. Anyway Dirk, we'll stop here today. I hope you at least read some of the beginner parts of Fire Theory. Yes, I did. Good. Then tomorrow morning, Forge 8. Be there and we'll begin. Understood. With that, Dirk left forging class. He had a smile on his face as he left the Hall of Artisans pleased by the day's developments. Since the rest of his day was free, Dirk decided to head home early. Upon arrival, he got comfortable did a destruction cycle. He was in agony for several minutes as he destroyed his blood and many veins, causing black and purple lines to surface on his skin. He sighed though as he finished. He had gone through many, many destruction cycles for his blood, yet it still wasn't finished. The only thing that indicated if he was getting close was less pain when carrying out the cycles, but not even that had gone down. His pain tolerance had only increased. Am I doing something wrong? It's been too much time. What if it's something like with my mana heart, and I need higher concentrations of anima? Interface, search my anima manual for text about increased anima densities. Searching. Dirk waited as his AI made a query. After several seconds though, he was surprised. 
No applicable results found. None? Weird. Dirk rubbed his chin. Was he just being impatient with his progression? He felt like there was something else though. Now that I think about it, my manual didn't have runic text. I was told it was high level. Wouldn't it have runic text if it were high level? Thinking of that, Dirk suddenly stood up. He quickly walked to his bedroom where he dove into his closet and sifted through neatly organized items. After a few seconds, he fished out his book, The Anima Resonance Destruction Technique. Dirk flipped it open, reading through the sections. Way back when, he had only seen ink on a paper. There wasn't anything magical about this book. But that was only through the eyes of his younger, inexperienced self. Now as he flipped through every page, Dirk was intrigued. Halfway through, he faintly spotted some runic lines. These lines followed some of the text, but others flowed through the entire page. After concentrating on a single page for a while, Dirk was actually able to make out a small runic formation that weaved itself throughout the page. It wasn't nearly as complex as the one he found in the dwarf's book, but it was elusive enough to not be obvious. Would you look at that? Wait, doesn't that mean my mana heart technique has runic formations too? Suddenly, Dirk dove back into his closet. After pulling out the large mana heart technique book, he flipped to the back. Whoa! When he stopped on a page, Dirk was hit with a wave of information. Looking at it through his magically developed eyes, Dirk could make out fading runic formations. The formation that covered the entire page showed only portions of itself as it seemed to fade in and out of existence. And when Dirk concentrated on one of the fading images, he was a bit overwhelmed by the runic complexity. It hurt his eyes and head. Jeez. I can't look at that for more than a few minutes. Just how complex is that rune? He was baffled as he flipped backward. After arriving at the halfway point, Dirk slowly glanced at the page. Thankfully, this one didn't have an overwhelmingly profound rune on it. Yet, the rune was still just as complex as the one Dirk had seen in the dwarf's book. A vast majority of the information within this book has been hiding in plain sight. I can't even look at the runes in the back. Maybe I should trace these though. Might as well. Shrugging, Dirk went back to his anima resonance destruction technique, going to the earliest page with runes on it and tracing them. In this book, the runes weren't so complex. As he began tracing them though, he found some oddities. These runes. They're not mana. He was surprised. The runes he had seen in the dwarf's book were made of fire and earth mana respective to the section. But these runes had no trace of mana in them. He did recognize the energy though. It's anima. You can actually enchant things with anima. I mean, it's a controllable energy, but I've never heard of someone taking it out of their body. Oh well. Deciding not to think too deeply about it, Dirk focused on tracing them. Despite not being mana, they traced just fine, but despite not being as complex as the other runic formations he saw, a single page still took two hours to trace. By the end, Dirk had to massage his temples. It took a lot of concentration to trace runes. But he wasn't a hasty person. After resting for a bit, he continued to trace runes. As long as he could get the runes into his AI, he could recall and study them as much as he wanted later. He didn't want to have to rely on a physical object that couldn't be taken everywhere with him. Like that, Dirk spent the rest of the day tracing. Even when Ava came home and made dinner, he didn't stop tracing. He only stopped to eat dinner, the pastime doubling as much needed rest. Finally, come night time, he was hit by a wave of mental exhaustion. He had told Ava that he was trying to comprehend runic formations on a page, something she didn't know existed either. She was surprised though at the mental toll it took on Dirk. She might think he'd been exerting himself, casting spells all day long with how tired he was. At least getting to bed was easy. The two were quick to fall asleep beside each other. While she wasn't as tired as Dirk, Ava was still more than done with the day. She had her alchemy class to take, and she was determined to do well in it. Unfortunately, it took a lot of mental and magical effort on her part. Such a complex profession wasn't easy to get good at. 
Chapter 79, Forging The next day, Dirk woke up a bit later than usual. He needed more time for his mind to recover from all the tracing the day before. But when he did wake up, he was refreshed. His mind was sharp, and he was eager to take on the challenges of the day. After having a nice morning and breakfast with Ava, the two left for their classes. Dirk didn't bother stopping by his enchanting class. Instead, he headed straight for the Hall of Artisans, specifically Forge 8. After a bit of searching, Dirk found himself at the top floor of the building. His destination was a large pair of doors, from then radiating cold nothingness. Around the edges of the door though were streaks of ash, as if clouds of dust had puffed through the openings and brushed the walls. Dirk knocked. Who is it? I'm busy here. It's Dirk. Dirk? Ah. Yes, come in. When Dirk heard his teacher's voice turn from hostile to welcoming, his mouth twitched a little. Had he already forgotten that he was going to be here? Dirk didn't mind too much though as he pushed through the doors. Upon entering, he was hit with a wave of heat and sprinkled with sparks that flowed through the air. The place was an oven, a stark contrast to the cool exterior of the doors. Dirk! Come in, boy, come in. I was just preparing for the day. The large bald dwarf was seen sitting beside a large anvil. On one wall was a huge furnace that spewed fire like a dragon. When one of these sparks landed on Dirk, he was surprised as his skin was actually burned. He quickly brushed the spark off. It looked like the fire within that furnace was of much higher tier than him. As for the dwarf, his face was covered in gray soot, some small hairs on his head burning from the intense heat. Dirk suddenly understood why he was bald. Hello teacher. Teacher? My name is Devasto Bastin. Students that go nowhere call me teacher. You will call me Sir Tobastin. Understood, Sir Tobastin. Good. Anyway, come over here. Let's get you started. The dwarf waved Dirk over, prompting him to dive deeper into the boiling air of the room. It was a bit stuffy, but Dirk dealt with it. He just made sure to dodge any sparks from the furnace. Forging is an art. It is no less profound than the likes of sculpting, enchanting, or alchemy. Through forging, one shapes not just metal, but any hard material into pieces of intricate design, breathing life into them. Through a baptism of fire, you can do miraculous things with all kinds of materials. It is not just alchemy that brings ingredients together to make something better. And it is not just enchanting that infuses power into objects. Forging does both of these things. Understand that forging is much more than just shaping metal on an anvil. Now take your shirt off. I'm sorry. Dirk tilted his head at the sudden odd request. Devos waved at him. What, you want your clothes to burn? A true forge master must bathe in the fire that he baptizes his creations with. This means your shirts will quickly disappear if you leave them on. Believe me, I've lost many a dozen. Oh. Dirk nodded in understanding. Even now the dwarf was shirtless, revealing an oddly shredded physique. It seemed like that was the way to go. Dirk pulled off his shirt, throwing it into his pocket ring. The dwarf nodded. A body worthy of a sculpture. That will make things easy. Now, allow me to explain what you'll be doing here from now on. The dwarf picked a hammer off the anvil. It was large in his hands and looked heavy. From now on, you're going to forge an item a day. I will tell you the item you will forge, and you must forge it. I will also give you all the specifications for the items you construct. I will give you the material, draw the shape, and explain the technique to build it with. Through this, you will learn about how fire interacts with the materials you utilize, how your body molds the material under your hammer, and how you breathe power into your creations. In this profession, you learn as you build. Now, let me give you your first item. Suddenly, the dwarf smacked a piece of parchment on top of the anvil alongside a large ingot of metal. This will be a basic iron tool. What you are going to make from this ingot is a pair of tongs. The tongs should be forged to look like the picture. As for the technique, well, let's not worry about that right now. 
that'll come a bit later when you actually know how to hammer right. Now, get started. I'll be here to correct your mistakes. Understood. Dirk quickly nodded. While everything was happening quickly, he was no stranger to moving just as fast. Without much thought, he grabbed the ingot on the anvil and walked it to the furnace. The furnace wasn't just an insulated pit in the wall. At its base was a large bowl about a foot deep with a covering that looked like a large pizza oven. Inside the bowl was what looked like flowing molten lava. Only, when Dirk looked closely, he found that this flowing lava was actually flowing fire. It looked like the fire was liquid as it swirled inside the bowl. As Dirk got closer, he could also feel how hot the radiant heat was. It was hard to look at it directly. Don't worry about being burned by the fire. I'll explain later, but I control the fire, thus you won't be burned to a crisp. Stick your arm inside the bowl and drop the ingot in. And don't guard yourself with mana while you do so. Dirk was silent as he hesitantly nodded. With every inch he got closer, the heat became worse. By the time he was right next to the bowl, he could feel his arm hairs slightly singeing. But he trusted his teacher. Raising the ingot, Dirk put his hand into the fire, making sure to not protect his body with his fire mana. When his fingers touched the fire, he was surprised to feel a cold sensation. It wasn't that it was cold. Maybe it was so hot that it felt cold to Dirk. Either way, there was no pain, only numbing as Dirk lowered in the ingot and dropped it. Then, he ripped his arm out. He could see the ingot rapidly redden inside the bowl. Good. Now take it out. Use these tongs. It was only a few seconds before Dirk saw the ingot become yellow hot. Turning around, he caught a pair of tongs from his teacher. These tongs were exceptionally high quality, likely his own. With them, Dirk grabbed the ingot, walking it over to the anvil. Now forge. With that, Dirk got to work. He grabbed the hammer the dwarf handed to him and began slamming the ingot. Surprisingly, the hammer was hard to wield. Dirk was shocked to feel that it weighed 60 pounds. He had to activate a bunch of anima just to wield it. Seeing Dirk struggle, the dwarf laughed. You got it. Lift those scrawny arms. When I'm done with you, you'll have arms as thick as a warrior's legs. A female warrior's legs, no less. Their legs are usually the thickest. Dirk was silent as he continued to struggle hammering the ingot, disregarding the dwarf's fantasies that began to escape his mind. He kept hammering away, the room filled with the booms of metal against metal. Every time Dirk hit the ingot, he could feel the shockwave reverberate back into his arm. The anvil he was on had no give at all, hard as diamond. If he accidentally tapped the anvil with his hammer while hammering the ingot, it would numb his hand with pain and he did indeed clip the anvil a few times. This only ensured that he increased his accuracy, hitting the ingot like he was supposed to. After getting used to it, all the force of his hits went into the ingot that had much more malleability than the anvil. And when the ingot cooled, Dirk just heated back up before continuing. Still, it took a lot of energy out of him. He had to consume lots of anima just to lift the hammer, let alone put enough power behind it to deform the ingot. All the while, the dwarf instructed him. Use this tool to split the ingot. You're making tongs. Put your whole body into the hit. There's no point in just using your shoulder. You think the hammer is all there is? Use your earth magic. I know you have the metal specialization too. The forge is practically begging you to hurry up and become a master. But no spell circles. Forging is all about harmonizing with the metal. You do that through harmonizing with the mana. Sir Tobastan guided Dirk with his vast breadth of knowledge, even going so far as to have Dirk use earth magic in conjunction with his forging. He taught him the way to move his body, what to concentrate on while hitting, how to move his mana, and more. And while Dirk had a bit of trouble keeping track of every little detail as he moved, he quickly got better, much to the dwarf's satisfaction. Finally, after almost an hour, Dirk had two long pieces of metal. When he brought these together, they would become tongs. He nodded when they came to be in the correct approximate shape. The dwarf nodded as well. Good. 
Normally, this is when you would harden the metal before heading to the grinder to finish off the shape. But you're not going to do that. You know why? The dwarf eyed Dirk fiercely. Dirk just stood there, not giving an answer he didn't know. It's because those tools are for amateur, no good half wits. Dirk! If you ever find a forge that has a grinder in it, then you have my permission to burn that place to the ground. No half competent forge master uses such disgraceful tools. Listen closely. The dwarf grabbed Dirk's shoulder, his rough hand scratching Dirk's skin. You shape the metal purely by your hand and hammer. All of it. You want to know how the best forge masters forge the most powerful swords and blades? Well, this is where I'm going to teach you. Watch very closely. Saying that, the dwarf grabbed one of the yellow hot metal poles that made one half of the tong. Then, before Dirk's eyes, the dwarf ran his fingers across the metal. Under his fingers, odd curves became flat, and flat corners became smoothly rounded. It seemed as if the iron was putty under his hands. But Dirk knew better. He could see earth mana flow through the dwarf's hands and into the metal. With this mana, he refined the shape of the metal. Although Dirk had a hard time seeing exactly how he did it, he could understand what was going on. When he was done, he held the half tong proudly. This is one of the principles behind metal theory. Earth mana is not just used in earth magic. If one can learn to manipulate it, then they can directly shape materials with a wave of their hand. You, my friend, also have the metal specialization, so you are the perfect man for this job. With metal mana, you can tap directly into metals like an earth mage would rock or dirt. And with your metal mana, you can precisely shape your metals however you wish. This is one of the foundations of a true forge master. However, what I used is not just earth or metal mana. You must use fire mana in conjunction. Watch me again. The dwarf picked up the other tong half. The deep red metal that had been cooling rapidly heat up again within his hands that spewed out a light film of fire. Then, the fire mana from his hands was infused into the metal along with metal mana. Like that, he perfected the shape of the tong. As he watched, Dirk did his best to see what the fire mana did. But he couldn't quite pin it down. Did it just heat up the metal? Was there something he was missing? The dwarf smiled. There. Remember this. Fire mana is not just heat that makes metals melt. Fire is something that ignites change. With fire, we can not only melt metals, but fuse them together. With fire, we can make metal bend to our will. With fire, we can breathe life into our creations. Forge masters use fire mana in conjunction with metal mana, fusing their powers together, turning something rigid into something soft that we can shape as we will. This is a complex technique that takes years to grasp and even longer to master. But above all, you don't learn it through study. You learn it through practice. Now start tempering those tongs. You have another item to make afterward. With that, the dwarf tossed the tongs onto the anvil, allowing Dirk to finish the process. After setting them to temper, he walked back to the anvil. Here! The dwarf slammed another ingot and piece of paper onto the anvil. The ingot was quite a bit larger than before, and the paper had the image of a hammer on it. Your next item. This time, you'll be using a mold to cast your hammer. It'll be a singular piece of metal, like mine is. You must first create your mold, though. To do this, you will use stone and carve your mold. Behold! Bang! Suddenly, the dwarf retrieved a large block of white stone from his pocket ring, slamming it on a table nearby. Dirk watched silently. Here is a hammer and chisel. Now, you must use your artistic talent in order to carve the stone to the shape of your hammer. I've designed the image on the paper to be identical to mine. You just need to get the proportions right. And don't worry, this stone is cheap. You will carve as many blocks as you need in order to get it perfect. Now begin. Learn as you go. Saying that, ten more blocks of stone appeared on the table. Dirk thought for a moment before going to the table, picking up the hammer and chisel, and going to work on one of the blocks. Interface. Awaiting orders. 
trace the image of the hammer onto the stone block. You know what I need to do. Affirmative. Suddenly, Dirk saw an image form itself on top of the block of stone in front of him. It outlined the image of the hammer. What Dirk needed to do was gouge out the stone that was the hammer, creating a mold to fill with metal. And when the image appeared, he got to work. He placed the chisel against the stone and began chipping away. At first, the hits were hard, taking out large chunks of stone. But when he got to the edges of the image, he slowed down, lightening his hits. At this point though, the dwarf spoke. Don't take so long. The carving process is supposed to be the easiest part. Use your earth mana to your advantage. Dirk was silent as he paused. Use his earth mana. Was he supposed to chip away at the stone with his earth magic? Or do I do the opposite? If I reinforce what can't be chipped, then I can hit harder without worry about messing up. Feeling enlightened, Dirk suddenly streamed his earth mana into the stone. After that, he reinforced the edges of the mold. The shape that couldn't be touched was hardened, and when Dirk went to hit the stone near it, the shape was accurately carved out. There was no need to tread lightly. Only, using his mana in such a precise way was a bit difficult. Nonetheless, with his willpower, he was able to precisely reinforce the stone. Like that, the mold was rapidly carved, Dirk moving faster as he got the hang of it. Unfortunately, toward the end when he got to the corners, his mind that was becoming fatigued didn't reinforce correctly, and with a hit of the chisel, a large chunk of stone came out. The dwarf popped out of his seat. No! You were so close. Start over. Damn. Dirk cursed as he looked into the mold. It was 80% finished, but one mishap meant his hammer wouldn't cast correctly. Sighing, he pushed away the failed mold before starting on another block. It took him nearly an hour to make the first one, but thankfully he had the benefit of experience. He quickly carved out the beginnings of the mold once more. Unfortunately, when it rains, it pours. Halfway through, Dirk made another mistake, and a large corner was taken right off by his heavy hand. The dwarf smacked his knee. Ha! Huh. So it's going to be like that, ha? Huh? Hurry up and start over then. And by the way, I'm setting a timer. If you go over the 80-minute mark without finishing, then you start over. You must find a balance between speed and accuracy. Saying that, the dwarf moved to another side of his forge. On the wall was a large clock, and he smacked it with his fist. Suddenly, the clock set itself, beginning a countdown eighty minutes long. Dirk frowned. He was just thinking that he needed to slow down and take his time, finishing it in one go instead of continually messing up. But the dwarf had other plans. Rubbing his head, Dirk got back to work. Like that. Dirk ceaselessly carved out stone. His arms and face were coated in white dust while the rest of his body dripped sweat. Every time he blew away the accumulating stone fragments, that white plume would coat his skin and get in his hair. But he didn't stop. If anything, such things were representative of his focus. He carved even as the dwarf stepped out to teach his classes for the day. And Dirk didn't cheat his way through the challenge. When eighty minutes were up and he wasn't finished, he pushed away the stone and started over. And whenever he messed up from rushing, he started over. It tested his patience, but Dirk knew this was good for him. It pushed his control over mana to new heights while stressing his concentration. This was valuable practice. Chapter 80 Elemental Manipulation Dirk carved stone for several hours. The process of going through eight blocks of stone wasn't quick. Thankfully, Sir Tobastan at least took care of Dirk's tongs at some point, ensuring they were finished properly. Other than that, the dwarf went through all his classes, and when he came back, Dirk was still carving. Now, his entire front side was coated in white dust, streaks going down his abs from drops of sweat that revealed his pale skin. When the dwarf walked back in, he peered over next to Dirk, seeing how he was halfway through this carving. He hadn't messed up yet but there was always something that happened that would end his carving in failure. In the other seven blocks, there was always just a single chunk of stone that wasn't supposed to be chipped. 
and if one was perfect, it wasn't finished since Dirk ran out of time. But this time, Dirk seemed to be at his deepest in concentration. The dwarf watched as he carved through 85% of the block, the image of a hammer being designed under Dirk's chisel. Then, he got almost all the way through. There was only one more corner to carve out. It was here that Dirk took a deep breath though, standing upright. Ding! A clock rang out, snapping the dwarf out of his reverie. He realized that Dirk had run out of time. Dirk pushed away the block of stone, preparing to grab another one. The dwarf wasn't having it though. Bah! Screw that clock! You are doing good! Just continue and finish. And don't mess up. All right. Dirk readily agreed. Grabbing the block of stone, he carved out the last corner inside of it. Then, with the final touches, he finally had a good product. Great! Now melt the ingot inside this pot before pouring it into the mold. That should be simple enough for you. Understood. Dirk grabbed the pot that Sir Tobastin handed to him, throwing the metal ingot into it before walking it to the furnace. There, he dipped the pot into the bowl of fire. The ingot melted rapidly as even the pot turned red hot. Dirk was impressed by the pot. It seemed to be a much stronger metal than the others. When the ingot was melted and turned to liquid, Dirk quickly walked it over and slowly poured it into the mold. Like that, the metal filled every corner of the stone block. When all the metal was in, the dwarf grabbed the mold with the liquid metal inside of it. Then, he placed the block on a rack above the bowl of fire. We need to let it slowly cool and harden. And with this metal, the tempering process will happen naturally as it is. By tomorrow, your hammer will be ready to take out of the mold, and you'll put on the finishing touches. As for today, you're done. Go on back home and rest. You did well. Tomorrow I'll have more planned for you. Understood. Dirk took a deep breath as he left the forge room, grabbing his shirt on the way out. He didn't even bother putting it back on. His dust-coated self was on full display as he walked back home. Of course, nobody in the Hall of Artisans was in the mind to care about him. They all had their own strenuous tasks to carry out. Ava was quick to gawk though when he arrived home. Oh my god. What the hell have you been doing? Sculpting. Weren't you taking a forging class? That's what I thought at first too. I need to clean. Dirk was too tired to explain as we walked himself straight to his bath. After a long soak, he came back down to see dinner on the table. Oh. Thanks. Sure. Dirk smiled as he sat down. After Ava joined him, the two ate a large meal before sitting around for a while. After several minutes of silence, Dirk opened his mouth. How's alchemy going? It's, all right. Ava lifted her head unsurely. The memorization part isn't too bad. Lots of ingredients and techniques and reactions to know. We aren't making our own concoctions though, so we just need to follow recipes for the most part. Still, actually making things work is difficult. It doesn't help when there's little Miss Genius getting all high and mighty either. Who? Drick tilted his head. Just some girl in the class who gets everything right. And she makes sure everyone knows she's the best. Worse yet is she has the skill to back it up. I'd try to shut her up otherwise, but she's a tier 4, as well. And best of all? She seems to have something against me specifically. Did you do anything to her? No. I didn't. My guess though. She likes Alec. I've heard rumors that she's been trying to get close with him, and me going on a dungeon dive with him is apparently overstepping my bounds. Ava spoke with derision, flailing her hands to enunciate her point. Dirk scratched his cheek. Was this gossip? She's a tier four, doesn't that mean she's older than him? Yup. Guess she just likes young guys. That or her family has connections with his. Either way, she hates my guts, and I can't do anything about it. And it's not like I do anything to her. I just keep my head low, and I haven't even seen Alec in how long? Yet she has it out for me. 
The bitch messes with me in the middle of my experiments, and since she's kissing the teacher's ass, he doesn't do anything about it. Heh, <sighs> there is one thing I got on her though. What? Dirk tilted his head as Ava smirked. She smiled at him. She's as flat as a board. Well, she's actually not that flat, but mine are much bigger than hers. I might be shorter, but damn if I don't have her where it counts. Ava smiled as he cupped her chest with her hands. Dirk glanced at her awkwardly. Was this really her measure of superiority? He shook his head. Well, good luck in class. Just keep working at it and I'm sure you can get better than her. Of course. At the very least I'll become more powerful. Then I can knock that arrogant bitch off her pedestal. A good goal to pursue. Dirk just gave her a thumbs up. This vengeful side of Ava, it was new and a bit surprising. Had she been hiding this all this time? Dirk didn't know if he needed to hear more gossip, but it wasn't bad hearing about her challenges. Unfortunately, it didn't seem like she was done. There's also this girl in my water class. Yesterday she snorted when I first came back to class. Now, I don't know if she was being mean, but several weeks ago before we had gone on any dives, she always liked to have a bit of attitude when she talked to me. And I heard from my friend that she was one of the people I'd beat during the tournament. But then I heard from someone else that she had a crush on a guy who was apparently staring at me, and she didn't like that, so now she's mad at me for no reason. Dirk was quiet as Ava began lecturing. At first he just listened, remembering the information she told him. He began building a large web in his head that connected points of conflict between all the names she threw out. But when he found out that there was no point to anything she was talking about, he began to zone out. Gradually he became unable to understand a word she said as the web grew to unfathomable proportions. Before he knew it, an hour passed, and they were still sitting at the table with dirty dishes in front of them. He stood and began cleaning, and Ava went to join him. But she still talked as they settled the house for the night. Even as he climbed in bed, she was still talking. When she jumped under the sheets next to him, he planted his hand over her mouth, silencing her. Sleep. Ava nodded meekly as he looked at her with tired but sharp eyes. With that, Dirk sighed and buried himself in his pillow. He quickly fell asleep afterward. First he had a day of strenuous sculpting before getting his ear talked off at the dinner table. He made a note to watch out for this in the future as his consciousness slipped away. The next day, Dirk was back at Forge 8. Upon arrival, Sir Tobaston had him extract his hammer from the stone mold. With that, Dirk had his own hammer and tongs. Those two tools were really the only ones he needed. At least, that's what Dirk thought until the dwarf started another lesson. Today I'm going to have you make a knife. This time though, instead of using the filthy grinder in the classroom, you'll be shaping it by your own hand. This will finally stress your control over metal and fire mana, putting it to the true test. Of course, I don't expect you to pick up on this quickly, but I do expect the barest results. You should at least be able to affect the knife using metal mana and magic. And remember, this isn't basic magic like what you've been learning. This is elemental manipulation. The sooner you start learning it, the greater you'll be later on. Now, here's your ingot and design. Start forging. With that, the dwarf tossed the ingot and paper at Dirk. Dirk didn't ask questions and immediately got to work. After heating the ingot, he began shaping it with his new hammer. Ting! Ouch! Dirk grimaced a bit when he brought down the hammer. Yesterday he had hit the anvil so many times that his palms were bruised from the reverberation through the hammer. Today he woke up feeling relatively fine, but now even the slightest vibration hurt his tender fingers. Of course, that didn't stop Dirk from slamming down the hammer anyway. His hammer was just as heavy as the dwarf's, if not heavier. This meant he needed to use anima to wield it correctly. His muscles were sore just like his hands as well. Still, he pushed through the pain. At the very least, the skin on his hands wouldn't break due to his skin destruction cycles, and sore muscles were never something Dirk minded. All of this was making him stronger. For almost an hour, the violent clangs of metal on metal shook Dirk's ears. 
and when he was done making the general shape of the knife, he stopped. Now grab the knife. When it's hot, it's easier to mold with your mana. That means you must use fire and metal mana to keep it soft and shape it. Of course, there's a balance between the two, but I'll let you find it. The dwarf spoke these words as Dirk grabbed the knife. The red-hot metal warmed Dirk's hands considerably, almost too much for his liking. After a few seconds, he felt pain on the skin of his fingers. The metal was burning him. Activate your mana, and get used to the heat. The dwarf shouted, prompting Dirk to infuse mana into the knife. First came fire mana. With that mana protecting him, Dirk was no longer burned by the red-hot metal. However, the metal started to cool the longer he held it. He couldn't have this, but even after filling the knife with his fire mana, he wasn't entirely sure how to heat it. Dirk had only generated fire with fire magic before. He had never directly increased something's heat with just his fire mana. At the same time though, Dirk had controlled things like rocks and dirt with earth mana directly. He wondered if it was the same concept. With that in mind, Dirk started to try and activate the mana inside the knife. He didn't form any runes, just attempting to garner a reaction from the mana while it sat inside the metal. However, nothing came to him. Then, he thought of something. Wait, I have resonance. It's probably not the same thing, but I don't know how to interact the mana with the metal otherwise. Let's try it. Thinking that, Dirk activated his skill. His AI also kicked in, and the fire mana began to fluctuate inside the metal. When Dirk enchanted, he had planted a rune onto a piece of leather using resonation. However, he didn't shape the fire mana into a rune this time. So when Dirk finally found the correct frequency to resonate at, there was no enchanting. Dirk was able to feel something though. He could feel the fire mana touching the metal. After that, he began thinking of how he wanted to heat the metal. Dirk concentrated. His concentration went deeper than it probably should have gone. He viewed all the fire mana that was inside of and around him, as well as the mana inside the knife. He wanted it to follow his will, to heat the metal like fire mana was supposed to. And he didn't want to do this with runes. Suddenly, Dirk had a thought. Would this be considered silent casting? It's not exactly magic. Dirk pondered for a split second before refocusing. In his mind, he imagined the knife heating up, the fire mana transferring its property of heat onto the metal. When this happened, Dirk felt something. The knife that had been cooling down suddenly stopped cooling. Dirk held the dark red knife in his hand, staring holes into it. His fire mana constantly resonated with the metal, and it sucked energy out of him. But to his joy, the metal no longer dropped in temperature. The dwarf saw this as well from the side. At first he wanted to tell Dirk to focus on shaping the knife with metal mana first because that was much easier than heating the knife. But when he saw Dirk so concentrated, as well as the fluctuating mana inside the knife, he thought Dirk might have something. And now, seeing how the knife maintained its temperature, the dwarf's eyes widened. You did it. You did it. Ha ha. I knew you were a genius. Oh, you can stop now. Ack. Dirk let out a rough exhale as he stopped resonating the mana. His head now throbbed in pain. It was just maintaining the temperature of the knife, but it took all his concentration. Still, Sir Tobastan smacked Dirk on the back. Boy, you're a true talent. You were only supposed to shape the metal. I was going to teach you heating metal with your fire mana later since I thought you would fail that part. But look at that. You actually took the first and most crucial step all by yourself. Do you know how difficult what you just did was? I consider myself a genius, but it took me months to even figure out how to affect the metal's heat with my mana. Hey, if you don't mind me asking, what's your fire affinity? It's 71%. Dirk answered without much hesitation as he rubbed his temple. Sir Tobastin was helping him a lot, and how could he possibly use that information maliciously? Dirk didn't particularly care either way. The dwarf was shocked though. Only 71%? How? I'll tell you what, I've got a fire affinity of 97%, 
and I actually performed worse than you. Bah! I thought you had perfect affinity. Are you sure about that percentage? You're not lying to me, right? No, I'm not lying. Hmm. I don't believe it. You are either the luckiest person in the world to be able to cross a significant magical threshold so easily, or your affinity is actually perfect. Whatever. Either way, you did well. Now you just need to shape the metal. Until you become able to actually heat the metal with your mana, just heat it in the fire. Now go on. This should be easy for you. The dwarf waved Dirk off to the furnace. Taking the knife, Dirk dipped it in the flame before taking it in his hands. After protecting his skin with fire mana, he infused metal mana into the knife. After a short amount of time, Dirk was able to affect the shape of the knife with his mana. It truly was easier than heating metal with fire mana. After resonating his metal mana, he felt like the mana became the knife itself. Then he just needed to move the mana how he wanted to, the metal bending with it. Like that, he was able to sharpen the blade of the knife and refine some odd imperfections. But although he figured out how to do it, Dirk found that actually bending metal was a black hole for his energy. It took nearly an hour to refine the shape of the knife, and by the end, he was totally exhausted. After Dirk collapsed against the anvil, Tobastin took the knife. Hmm, good. Really, you are a little genius. But don't get cocky. This is still far from satisfactory. For instance, you ruin the internal structure of the knife while shaping it. You think you can just brute force the shape? It takes delicate technique in order to shape the metal and maintain its strength. For now though, this will do. I'll scrap this garbage. As for you, go on and go home. Your performance today was well above expectations. Tobastin nodded approvingly as he casually tossed the knife into the fire pit. Dirk didn't mind this. It truly was ruined by his shaping, something he noticed as it happened. But Dirk had only cared about being able to shape the metal, not doing it well, so he didn't care about ruining it. And since he was done for the day, Dirk grabbed his shirt and walked out. Before he did though, Tobastin waved. Hang on. Take this for the day. When you begin to recover, go ahead and read the fire theory section some more. You won't get much further in skill without knowledge like this. The runes that you had been looking at a couple days ago contain elemental knowledge on fire manipulation pertaining to directly heating materials like what you were doing. It gets more complex the deeper you go, but just worry about trying to comprehend the runes. Analyzing runes is an important skill for any skilled mage. But I want this book back. So don't lose it. With those words, Tobastin handed Dirk a book. It was the one he gave Dirk during class only two days prior. After feeling the cover in his hands, Dirk smiled. Now he could trace more runes. Thank you, Sir Tobastin. Sure, sure. Now go on. You need rest. With that, Dirk left the forge. After putting the book into his pocket ring, he slung his shirt over his shoulder and walked out of the Hall of Artisans. Cool air graced his sweaty skin as he emerged outside. Oh, that reminds me. I should probably speak to Geralt. Yes. I am right here, my prodigious student. Ah. Chapter 81, Contraband Slash Apprentice When Dirk heard an overly enthusiastic shout from behind him, he was startled into a fighting stance, flipping around with a drawn knife. Now in front of him, Geral recoiled at Dirk's pointed weapon. After a second though, Dirk drooped as he sheathed the blade. It was just his teacher. Seeing Dirk calm down, Geral smiled and straightened his back. He was currently dressed in bright green jester clothes, a large top hat on his head with a giant feather sticking out the top, not the side. Dirk tilted his head at the foot and a half-long green feather that rose to the sky like a sword. Why are you here, teacher? After processing the odd clothes and glancing at the empty sleeve of Geralt's coat, Dirk finally asked. Geralt smiled brilliantly. Why, to speak to you, of course. I must say, you're wanting to speak with me and my coincidental meeting with you is truly fate. Say, I have a bottle of alcohol here, 
courtesy of the generous Master Shen. He left it out just for me. So should we toast to this occasion? Ha! Huh. No. Dirk rubbed his forehead, half expecting to hear the roar of an infuriated alchemist any moment. When nothing happened though, he sighed. Geralt put away the bottle. Shame. I hear he had been aging it for nearly three hundred years. It must really taste good. Nonetheless, we aren't in a fine dining environment. This wouldn't be the appropriate place to open such a bottle. Anyway. I digress. Dirk, my pupil, I have come to a startling realization. What is it? Dirk was confused as Geralt suddenly took out a book. Looking at the cover, he saw the title Voidwalking. The spell book? Yes. It turns out, I've been conned. There aren't any runic pages within this book. Is that right? Dirk was a bit baffled as Geralt showed him the pages. He had just been meaning to speak to Geralt about this, but he actually found out first. Indeed. I had been in the process of transcribing the book, and that's when I had this epiphany. Those dirty scam artists. I think the Academy was just protecting its property. The Academy? No, I'm not speaking of them. I mean the Empire that handed the Academy these faulty books. They're trying to scam this magnificent institution of highly valuable knowledge. I'm sorry. Dirk's face turned incredulous. How the hell did he come to that conclusion? The Academy was an institution directly underneath the Empire. Why would they scam them of books? Garrel raised his head high. You heard right. But fret not. I recently found where the genuine, original copy of these books are through some unsavory but useful friends I found lingering around this place. At first they tried to run and disappear with their black cloaks, but I was able to tempt them with some potions. Truly, they were very secretive people, and they ran a high price. But I was able to get what I wanted. I suppose I should thank Master Shing for sponsoring this exchange. Dirk was silent as Geralt followed his own train of thought. Unsavory people? The genuine copy? What was this teacher getting himself into? Before Dirk could speak to reprimand him though, Geralt got back to the point. Anyway. Here you go. Suddenly, he raised his arm. For books appeared above his hand. Dirk had a bad feeling. These are the books I found. There's Curse of Darkness and Void Walking, both books containing the original techniques themselves. Along with these, I found two more that you might like since I can't have my pupil be educated by low quality texts. They are called Theory of Stealth and Series of Lightning. These books were rather difficult to attain, but nobody can stop my ultimate technique. Now, these books are yours. Geralt suddenly pushed the books into Dirk's chest. He grabbed them, their weight bearing down on his arms. The covers of these books were made of scale leather that Dirk had never seen before, the scales so fine that the book titles could still be engraved as if they were on metal. They also radiated intense power that spoke of the profound runic pages within. Now, Dirk was certain that Geralt had done something extremely illegal. On one hand, he wanted nothing to do with these books. On the other, he was now really tempted by the runes within. If he could trace these. Suddenly, Dirk lifted his head, and with his AI, he scanned all around him. After seeing nobody suspicious, he instantly put the books into his pocket ring, the contraband disappearing from his arms. I'm going to hang on to these for now. You can't tell anyone. On my life, I would never. And you must cover your tracks. Nobody can know you stole these. HM, I didn't steal them but I understand what you say. Any investigators will understand that this was done for the good of the academy. Sure. Dirk couldn't bother correcting him, just giving a thumbs up. To this approval, Geralt pat his chest. Very well. My work here is done. Now, if you'll excuse me, a lucky lady happens to be waiting for me right now. Lucky lady? Indeed. Romance never dies, my friend. I've been pursuing this lovely flower for almost a year now. She's always so busy with her classes and students, but I have finally grasped my opportunity. 
I'm taking her to a secluded restaurant in the city. Oh! Such a thing deserves a toast. Perhaps I should bring out Master Xing's bottle for the dinner. If you don't mind, of course. Geralt turned to Dirk like a puppy awaiting its master's word. Dirk gave him an awkward smile. You have my blessing, teacher. Fantastic. It will make for a magical eve dash. Geralt. Oh. Suddenly, there was a guttural roar that shook the academy. Moments later, the ground rumbled with fast approaching steps. Geralt panicked ever so slightly. Anyway, that's my cue. Wish me luck. Good luck, teacher. With a smile, Geralt was enveloped by darkness, disappearing with a blur. That was void walking, a skill he was obviously proficient at. After that, Master Xing appeared. As if he were a bloodhound, he sniffed out the dark mana in the atmosphere. Dirk swore he could see all the mana within the surrounding twenty meters get sucked right into his nostrils. Xing spoke with a friendly but obviously enraged face as he rapidly approached Dirk. Excuse me, Dirk. Have you seen that good-for-nothing rat named Geralt? He just disappeared. I'm sorry. Damn. That thieving no life. Hear me Geralt. I'm going to get you alive the next time I see you. I've been planning to drink that bottle for over a hundred years. You will not take this away from me. Master Xing roared with rage, the surrounding students turning to the short, pudgy elf in curiosity. Dirk could only sigh. It must be difficult, having a slippery nemesis like Geralt. After letting out a bit of anger, Master Xing turned back to Dirk. He, sorry friend. I'll take my leave now. I understand. Dirk nodded. After Master Xing stomped off in another direction, Dirk also took his leave quickly heading back to his house. Upon arrival, Dirk found that Ava wasn't home. It was still around noon, so she was likely in her alchemy class. Thankfully, that allowed him some alone time to trace some books. Despite the throbbing headache he still had, Dirk was quick to open up one of the four books he was given. The first was the one called Theory of Stealth. Dirk wasn't sure what to expect from this. It was a very thick book with a width of nearly five inches, though only the second thickest among the four. After reading the introduction though, Dirk was quickly immersed. Stealth and Darkness The fundamentals and concepts behind distorting the body's presence, concealing aura, withholding aura, and erasing your existence from the world. Dirk scanned through the introduction which was a whole three pages. After this, he found nothing but runic pages. The early pages in the book weren't that complex, Dirk able to make out much of the meaning with mere glances. But with every page in this huge book, the runes got more and more profound until Dirk couldn't so much as look at the runes. This book, it contains everything one needs to know about stealth as a whole. It's not a single spell or technique, but I'm sure there are many skills and spells contained inside this thing. This is definitely extremely valuable. Dirk was baffled by what he saw. This book really did contain the most fundamental knowledge and theories behind what stealth was. It was no secret that dark mages often utilized spells that were stealthy by nature. Void walking was one of these spells and definitely popular despite its difficulty. But this book contained knowledge that formed the basis for those spells. Just the runes that he couldn't look at in the back of this book told him how valuable it was. Before Dirk got too immersed though, he quickly grabbed another book. This was called Series of Lightning, and it was the thickest book among the four that Geralt gave him. It was an entire eight inches thick. Dirk opened this book. When he did, the hair on his arms stood up as an electric field was created. He read the introduction. A series of theories on lightning, electrical fields, and plasma, alongside specialized spells and techniques for these theories. This book is actually filled with spells? Dirk was surprised yet again. When he flipped through the pages, he could see all kinds of runic formations. And there were many that looked like spell formations with mana circuits and magic circles. More than that though, this person actually knew what electricity and plasma were. That's kind of amazing. I can learn a lot from this book. But seriously, how did Geralt manage to steal this stuff? 
I definitely shouldn't be reading this. Hopefully this doesn't get traced back to me. Dirk mumbled as he flipped through a few more pages. After that, he took a deep breath, closing the lightning book and opening the book the dwarf gave him. He was quick to begin tracing runic pages within that book. Now more than ever, Dirk was adamant about tracing these runic pages. Besides his anima and mana techniques, Dirk didn't have the luxury of keeping these for a long time. Four of them were stolen goods that belonged to the Empire while the other came from his teacher who wanted it back. In order to get as much out of these as possible, Dirk needed to scan them as much as he could. That would allow him to study them later. His AI was turning out to be his most valuable tool, but he needed time in order to make use of its abilities. So despite the fact that Dirk still had a huge headache from the earlier forging session, he began tracing Tobastin's book. He moved slower than usual since it was harder to concentrate, but he was gradually able to acclimate. Digital lines constantly corrected themselves to the runic lines around the page in his vision, and a percentage meter slowly but surely increased. Like this, Dirk spent the rest of his day tracing. Since tracing runes didn't take mental energy like magic did, he was able to recover while tracing. Even then though, when Ava finally got home later in the night, Dirk had to pull his bloodshot eyes away from the books. His mind was in an odd state of being energetic from his mental energy regeneration and utterly exhausted from concentrating on the tracing. It was like he couldn't decide if he was tired. His body was able to decide for him though. After eating dinner and spending some time listening to Ava talk about her day, Dirk instantly fell asleep upon climbing into bed. Ava was also quick to fall asleep. Her days spent concentrating on alchemy weren't easy, and she was mentally and emotionally drained after each day. The next morning, Dirk woke up rejuvenated. The constant stressing of his mind during his forging lessons and runic tracing was resulting in gradual growth. After a nice and quiet breakfast with Ava, Dirk left for Forge 8. Upon arrival, Tobastin had another lesson planned for him. More forging was the gist of the lesson. As Tobastin said, you learn forging by forging, not by studying books. He had Dirk stressing his body under heat and the weight of his hammer while utilizing difficult techniques. There were constant corrections that the dwarf made to Dirk's movements and skills, but Tobastin was extraordinarily pleased with Dirk's quick progress. Dirk never complained and he did his best to step up to the dwarf's expectations. He wouldn't hesitate to put himself through physical or mental pain in order to refine his products to their utmost. And forging truly did turn out to be terribly difficult. This was especially so when Tobastin introduced him to another technique. This technique involved Dirk infusing his power into the metal with each swing of his hammer. There were forge masters who wielded a variety of different elements, and if they wanted to build a product with a specific attribute like earth or air, then to get the best results they needed to infuse that mana into their piece. This happened during the forging process. Tobastin wanted Dirk to infuse fire mana into his works. This was done not just by filling the metal with fire mana, but by attaching the fire mana to the metal similar to enchanting. From what Dirk understood, each swing of the hammer would vibrate the metal, and one would need to drive the mana into the metal through this vibration. Dirk quickly understood that this was a kind of mana resonation technique. Through resonation, the metal would take on the properties of fire mana, allowing the product to be used in conjunction with fire-type spells. It was a very common technique among half-decent forge masters according to the dwarf. After all, a forge master needed to be able to tailor the elements of their product to the customer. While the forge master had to have the applicable element, there were enough forge masters that one didn't need to worry about not finding one with their element. However, there was another important detail Tobastin told Dirk about. Infusing metals with elemental power is secondary to the metal you are working. Mid to high level forge masters always use metals and materials that are already filled with the element. This is because a forge master can only infuse so much mana, a level that is almost always lesser than materials which have accumulated an element for a long time. This is why infusing mana is a common skill among any basic forge master, because low level forge masters and their customers don't usually have access to quality elemental materials. 
Anyway, you need to learn infusion as well as how to control the elemental power of materials, channeling that power into something the weapon and customer can use. Tobastan spoke while Dirk forged, and Dirk did his best to listen and work. At first Dirk just thought these were some words of wisdom Tobastan wanted him to know and that Dirk would practice such things later. But the next day, Dirk was surprised to see Tobastan pull some light red metal out of his pocket ring. He said it was called Infernia, a metal that was attributed with the fire element. This was an extremely popular metal that was used in all kinds of fire-type constructions. And along with this metal's introduction, Tobastan explained some things about it. Metals like this, ones that have elemental attributes, are divided by grades. Put simply, the metal is graded according to its inherent elemental power, and each grade corresponds with our own tiers. Grade 3 Infernia can be used to its fullest capacity by a tier 3 mage and so on. Of course, each element has its own elemental metals. Aerolite for air, Prismatica for water, Geode for earth, Void metal for dark, and Hallowed steel for light. As a forge master with your elements of fire, earth, and dark, you'll only be handling Infernia, Geode, and Void metal. Technically you could forge with other elements, but the end product wouldn't realize its fullest potential power. Tobastan casually explained, but Dirk had his AI store this information as notes. He didn't have elemental weapons or items, so this was good to know if he ever decided to replace his current loadout. And after introducing the ingot of Infernia, Tobastan had Dirk forge with it. The ingot he brought out was actually grade 3, a valuable piece of metal and yet the dwarf didn't seem to care about wasting it on Dirk for his learning. Suddenly, Dirk realized that Tobastan was taking this whole training thing more seriously than he thought. Dirk didn't say anything though. He just smiled a bit and went with it. Between them, an unspoken relationship was gradually formed, that of a master and his apprentice. Chapter 82, Hopeless Romantic Dirk's schedule was gradually consumed by two things. Tobastan's forging lessons and runic tracing. Every morning after a breakfast with Ava, Dirk would head to Forge 8 and undergo a strenuous but productive forging session with the dwarf. These sessions lasted around six hours and covered all kinds of topics that stressed Dirk's magical and even physical skills, teaching him myriads of techniques that not only helped his forging ability, but his overall magical comprehension. On top of that, Dirk discovered an unexpected benefit after several days. His body was filled to the brim with fire mana, and his second mana heart of fire was actually taking on form. Dirk hadn't cultivated his mana heart much, but he didn't totally neglect it either. Yet, despite his lack of continuous cultivating and condensing, the mana heart didn't dissipate. Normally the mana heart would lose its concentration as mana was pulled into the blood or naturally released. But because Dirk was inside Forge 8 all day, a room with so much fire mana and heat that Dirk sweat despite his strong body and fire resistance, the fire mana in his body reached surprisingly dense levels. This kept his mana heart from thinning and actually thickened it. After discovering this, Dirk made it a habit to condense his heart before and after entering the forge. Like that, he was able to utilize this fire mana to its fullest. He didn't even need the magic pyramid and its dense mana rooms. Forge 8 was plenty. Besides forging though, Dirk's concentration was almost entirely focused on runic tracing. After getting into a cyclical schedule, Dirk began waking up earlier and staying up late. Every morning he would wake before Ava and trace runes for a few hours before beginning his day. And in the evening, he would trace even more until the dead of night. This gave him nearly 10 hours to trace runes despite being in the forge for 6 hours a day. While sitting around for 10 hours each day with his nose in a book was boring and tedious, Dirk didn't hesitate to deal with it. The books he had his hands on were too valuable to not trace. His anima and mana techniques were a given. That knowledge would lay the foundation for his rise to power. But then there were the other five from his teachers. Four of them were stolen but valuable goods that contained magic theory, powerful spells, and profound techniques. The other was from Tobastan and held techniques that would help his forging and elemental control. Dirk was almost too obsessed with tracing these books, but he didn't care. 
sure he would have access to his techniques and Tobaston's book for however long he wanted, but he wouldn't have his hands on the stolen goods forever. Thus, those became his top priority. Besides, Dirk would rather have those books stored in his AI anyway. That would ensure he would never lose the knowledge. Dirk liked such assurances. So for three weeks, this obsessive and cyclical routine continued. And it paid off greatly. Dirk became much more proficient in forging. After so many days under Tobaston's direct tutelage, he went through hundreds of pounds of metal and forged dozens of items from weapons to even armor. Most of them were crappy failures, but some of them came out nice. Dirk was especially proud of a knife he made using Infernia. With that knife, he could use fire attacks in conjunction with his stabs. It became his new daily carry weapon that was hidden on his person. Tobaston was especially pleased with Dirk's progress. While Dirk had only just begun to embark on the road of a forge master, it was amazing that he could take those first few steps in such a short amount of time. Tachinkali, with a bit more experience, Dirk could open his own low-level forging shop in some town if he wanted. While such a thing was far from his true potential, Dirk was still only thirteen and a half years old. What would become of him in five or ten years as he grew as a mage and a forge master? Tobaston was excited to see it, and during the lessons he gave he was constantly laughing and cheering for Dirk and Joy. Dirk was also proud of himself. He quickly discovered this, but he absolutely loved forging and making things with his own hands and strength. While he was still a beginner in the many techniques Tobaston taught him, he knew he would make progress over time. And his labor bore fruit as he got better and better. His blades became sharper, his arms stronger, his mana more precise, and his products more powerful. Every time he succeeded, he smiled in approval and felt motivated to do more. He didn't only make progress in forging either. After nearly 200 hours of runic tracing across three weeks of time, Dirk made fantastic progress. It wasn't anywhere close to tracing the deepest runic pages of his books, but Dirk was able to completely trace the beginning and some of the intermediate parts of each book. Dirk estimated that he had only attained knowledge at about the tier 4 and 5 level. But that was more than enough for him. He was barely at the tier 3 realm and that was only for his earth element. He had a long way to go until he reached tier 5. Still, Dirk couldn't help but sigh. 200 hours was a lot, and he had invested so much of his focus. Yet, across his mana and anima techniques, the stolen spellbooks, and Tobaston's forging book, he was still only able to trace intermediate information. It wasn't even half of all the runic pages. He realized that there was so much more to magic than he initially thought, as if he were a frog taking a peek out of a well. And he suspected that he wouldn't be able to gain much more even if he invested another 200 hours. The difficulty rose dramatically as he got deeper in. He couldn't even look at the later pages, let alone trace them. In fact, he tried to force himself to attempt to trace the most complex pages out of curiosity. The result was him crying tears of blood after getting sharp pains in his head. That little incident had startled Ava, and she forced him to shut the books for the rest of that day. Regardless, the end conclusion was that he needed to stop tracing and start comprehending. So at the end of the third week, Dirk stopped tracing pages for ten hours each day, instead simply reading the books how they were supposed to be read. This made his days pass by quite a bit easier. There was one thing that lingered on his mind though. I never completed the enchantment that teacher gave me. Dirk recalled his enchanting class. His return to that class was met with the stuck-up asshole of a teacher handing him a challenge. He was supposed to enchant an item within two weeks by himself, and if he didn't do so, he was better off not coming back. The challenge wasn't actually a problem for Dirk. But after he began lessons with Tobaston, he realized that he didn't want to and wouldn't put up with such a sorry excuse for a teacher. It was unfortunate that he wouldn't receive guidance in enchanting, but Dirk didn't care. He enjoyed forging too much, or perhaps more than that, he enjoyed forging under Tobaston's tutelage. So Dirk just never went back. He was already well past the deadline for his challenge, and the teacher surely wouldn't welcome Dirk back even if he walked in there with the completed product. 
so Dirk never thought about it again, just focusing on what was in front of him. Like that, Dirk's life became peaceful and enjoyable. Every day he would forge with Tobastin and study his books, constantly deepening his comprehensions. Dirk always smiled when he would emerge from Forge 8 with a sweaty body only to be graced with a cool breeze outside the Hall of Artisans. And after cleaning up at home, he would lay back with a book until Ava got home. He would end his nights with dinner and time spent with Ava. The two gradually became closer and closer. Ava always had a story to tell after a long day of alchemy and socializing. After the two ate dinner, Dirk would recline on the couch with his book, and Ava would recline within his arms. As he read his book from over her shoulder, she would go on about her nemesis, the things she learned during alchemy class, or whatever gossip she heard from her friends. In this way, Dirk had become fantastic at multitasking, being able to analyze runes while also listening to her stories. While he didn't bother to remember every detail, he could pick up on the gist and agree with her conclusions that her nemesis was an arrogant, prissy princess. He also realized that Ava was showing real passion for alchemy. She always spoke with great wonder about the various techniques and ingredients she used in concoctions. While Dirk obviously wasn't as social as Ava, not so much as making a single other friend outside of her and Alec, she didn't mind his reclusive nature. For Ava, her day was filled with drama and stressful study for alchemy. While she spent a lot of time with her friends outside of alchemy doing who knows what, at the end of the day, she always returned to the quiet household where her favorite person was. Dirk was that warm blanket that comforted her after an emotionally draining day. Sometimes, the two wouldn't even speak to each other, just being in each other's presence. Sometimes that was enough. And perhaps it was their lack of training, but the dynamic of their relationship had changed. Before, Dirk was always the strict man who would train alongside Ava, him acting as her mentor that pushed her to be the strong girl she wanted to be through body-numbing exercise. But they never trained anymore. Dirk was too busy with his forging and studying while Ava was busy with alchemy and her own magical studies. They had taken to their own, separate responsibilities. Dirk was no longer the stoic trainer who dished out bruises with martial arts lessons. Now, he was just the boy that she could laugh with and talk to. They had been brought close after their encounters during the dungeon dives, both of them realizing that they could rely on the other. Dirk could rely on Ava during battles with monsters, and Ava could rely on Dirk to take care of things she shouldn't yet be faced with. For Dirk, it was the first time he had a partner to lean on and trust, and perhaps unconsciously he realized that he no longer had to be the sole source of support. Ava could take care of herself. Both of them were pursuing their newfound passions despite any difficulties that arose. The two could just enjoy each other. Of course, Ava was the one who was more forward with their relationship, but it was a dynamic that seemed to work for them. Like that, both of their lives took turns for the better. Unbeknownst to either of the two oblivious birds though, dark schemes were brewing in the background, and there was one event that set these dark plans into action. It was close to a month since Dirk had returned from his dungeon dive and began his new schedule filled with forging and runic analysis. Late in the noon, Dirk emerged from the Hall of Artisans. His sweaty body was graced by the cooling air of the evening, and he took a deep breath as had become habit for him. Raising his hand, he pinched the ends of a few strands of hair, putting out a tiny flame. His hair occasionally caught on fire or got singed, so he had to put it out or risk going bald like Tobastin. Luckily his hair remained healthy and luscious, a perk from his skin destruction. With that, Dirk began his walk home. He walked away from the busy areas of the school and crossed into the residential areas. His body was on autopilot as he walked down the street between rows of houses, but when he was nearing his house, something caught his eye. A rather handsome man dressed in a dark blue suit was sitting atop the roof of a house. In his one hand was an instrument similar to a guitar, and he strummed it with a sorrowful voice. Oh Delia, how your eyes shone like the majestic twinkling stars. Oh Delia, how I am empty without your vibrant, joyful smile. What the hell? Dirk stopped in his tracks as he saw this man strum a sad tune. Hearing the voice though, his eyes suddenly twitched. Garol? Oh Deliha! How I miss you so! 
Oh my Della, how I would give the world just for you. Garol. Oh my Dirk. No, don't add me to your song. Dirk stopped Garol before he could sing something about him. Sighing, he rubbed his forehead. Gear no, teacher. What's going on? Oh Dirk, there's no need to call me teacher. A failed romantic such as myself could not possibly impart wisdom in the field I love so dearly. Please, address me by my name. Our friendship runs deep, after all. Dirk was silent, unsure of what to say. Since when did they have a deep friendship? Even if they did, it was exceedingly one-sided. Dirk didn't think much before just going along with it. All right then. Garol. What happened? I've been abandoned, my friend. My love has moved on without me, a beautiful stallion that ran off without the rider that is I. Ah! The depths of my sorrows. Oh, Deliha! Stop! Dirk waved his hands as Geralt strummed another tune, preventing him from singing another song. So he was dumped. I guess that sucks. After realizing what happened, Dirk felt a bit bad. Although he could totally understand the girl, it remained that Geralt cared enough to be hurt by this failed attempt at love. At first Dirk thought about just walking away and staying out of this mess. But feeling a little empathetic, he decided to be a decent person. It would be heartless of him to just abandon another man in his time of need. Question was though, what was Dirk to do with this hopeless romantic? Ah, Geralt? I don't know why I'm doing this. But would you like to stop at my house for a DRI dash? Yes. I will happily accompany you, my friend. Flipping a switch, Geralt immediately jumped off the roof of the house with a bright smile. Dirk's mouth twitched a bit with a strained smile. All right then. Follow me. Of course. Say, I recently spoke with those unsavory but useful friends of mine. They've expressed great interest in the school's magical formations. Of course, because they were so kind to help me previously, I didn't mind helping them in return. Favors must be repaid. Only then will you sow good fortune for the future. Geralt spoke as they walked to Dirk's house. Upon arrival, Dirk invited Geralt inside. It was then that he finally stopped talking, looking around at the house. Wow! It's a boring house but it has its own charm. I say it perfectly suits you. Does that mean I'm boring? Dirk mumbled to himself as he grabbed a bottle of juice. He didn't have wine or anything of the sort, but he was sure Geralt wouldn't mind. Sure enough, after pouring a couple of cups, Geralt happily drank what was offered. Ah! Delicious! It has been a while since I've had regular juice like this. Here, I shall trade for this drink. Saying that, Geralt took out a bottle. It was the wine bottle that Geralt was gifted from Master Shen. Only, the bottle was opened. Dirk titled his head. Didn't you drink that during your date? Ah, indeed I did. There's only a cup left inside. I suppose you could say this represents the dwindling fire of love between Deliha and I. Oh Deliha. Strum. Taking out his guitar. Geralt suddenly flicked the strings in sorrow. Dirk facepalmed as he began another song. Meanwhile, the door to the house suddenly opened. Dirk? Ava walked in cautiously when she heard some odd noises. When she saw Dirk in the kitchen with a mysterious musician, she tilted her head. Dirk walked over to her, leaving Geralt to his whiskey blues. She whispered to him. What's going on? Who is that? That's my dark element teacher. His name is Geralt. Wait, the one who almost killed you with that potion? Yep. Why is he here? He recently got dumped by a girl he liked. That sucks, I guess. But again. Why is he here? Ava asked more specifically. Wasn't this man a teacher? It was a bit unprofessional to go to a student with personal matters. And what was with that song he was singing? She couldn't understand the situation. Dirk sighed. He's. Well, using his words, our friendship runs deep, and I felt bad enough to invite him for a drink after pulling him off a roof. 
then he started singing after becoming sad again. All right then. Ava wasn't sure what to do except nod. She was confused, but she had heard about this teacher of Dirk's and knew he was an eccentric man. She just decided to go with the flow. With that, the two turned back to the depressed musician, pondering what they could do to help. Chapter 83, Taken For a while, Dirk and Ava decided to let Geralt sing his heart out. At some point, Dirk pulled out a book and read it on the side, tuning the man out. When he was finally done though, he let out a big sigh. Dirk perked up when the guitar disappeared from under his arm. At the same time, Ava walked out of the kitchen holding a large pot of soup. In the time Geralt was singing, she had made an early dinner. Here you go, Mr. Geralt. For me? Well aren't you the sweetest young lady? Dirk sure is a lucky man to have you by his side. Ah, thanks. Ava smiled sweetly at the genuine compliment. Afterward, Geralt took a large serving of the soup. Mmm. It isn't rich in manna, and the flavor isn't explosive. But it's got the comforting warmth of a home-cooked meal. It's delicious. Geralt spoke as he ate another spoonful of the meat soup. Ava smiled even brighter. She was starting to like this man and his praises. I'm glad you like it. Have as much as you want. I give my thanks to the chef. If you don't mind. Saying that, Geralt suddenly grabbed the pot of soup. Ava was stunned when he brought the entire thing to his mouth, lifting it like a cup of juice. Dirk stared at the man incredulously as he drank the pot of soup in its entirety. That was an entire dinner for them as well. Geralt licked his lips with a smile after setting the pot down. Truly, good food. I haven't had a humble meal like this in ages. Say, is there more? Uh. Ava was unsure as she looked at Dirk. Dirk just sighed, shrugging his shoulders. Ava turned back to Geralt with a small smile. I'll put on some more. You have my praises, Chef Ava. Geralt clapped as Ava went back to the kitchen. Dirk also got up to help. After that, they made three more meals. They brewed another pot of soup, cooked a large slab of meat, and baked a few loaves of bread. And when they set the table, the two couldn't even sit down before Geralt ate all three meals. They watched as three more dinners worth of food disappeared. Thankfully, it seemed to be enough. After Dirk and Ava cooked two more meals, Geralt was only able to eat one, leaving the other for them. Have you had your fill? Ava asked Geralt with a strained smile. He alone had eaten their entire food stock. Not that they couldn't buy plenty more, but still. Geralt just nodded in his seat, his stomach bulging out of his nice blue suit. Indeed. I thank the chef again for her wonderful cooking. Sure. Ava passive-aggressively responded. Then, she clapped her hands. Anyway. I think it's about time we close up for the night. Mr. Geralt, why don't Dirk and I escort you home? A double escort? I've never had a double escort before. Then it'll be a new experience. Come on. Let's go. Ava motioned Geralt out of his seat. The man quickly rose, happily trotting to the door while hypothesizing about what a wonderful walk they would have back to his house. Ava smiled at Geralt before looking at Dirk who reclined against his chair. Hey, let's go. Do I have to? Oh, yes you do. We're in this together, mister. Ava pulled Dirk's arm. Like that, they left the house and stepped into the night. Geralt looked up and smiled at the two moons in the sky. Ah, such beautiful moons. Light and dark, chaos and order. Did you know that some believe the two moons to be bridges to other worlds? Perhaps they hold worlds within themselves. There are also those who believe that those two moons hold the sources of power for all light and dark magic. So many legends were created around these moons, and yet so few people have actually set foot on those majestic celestial bodies. Geralt spoke with enraptured wonder. Realizing the implication of his words though, Dirk was shocked. Wait, people actually walked on those moons? Well, the stories aren't for certain, but I believe there are those that have. Think about it. 
Tier 8 masters attain power that can rend mountains in two, set the skies afire, and create entire oceans. How could one not have been curious about those moons? Curiosity knows no bounds, and to those unfathomable existences, those moons represent great unknowns. I refuse to believe that there hasn't been one that couldn't make such a dream come true. Maybe. Dirk nodded after a moment. He wasn't sure what the power of a tier 8 looked like, but Garrel was right. Who wasn't curious about those moons? There was no way at least one person didn't at least try their luck. Ava also dove into thought. Only, Garrel wasn't done with his train of thought. Ah, this night, those moons. Oh Deliha. They can't compare to your beauty. Oh God. Dirk and Ava simultaneously facebombed as Geralt brought out his guitar again. Like that, the two walked with him back to his home, his sorrowful voice ringing out the entire way. Finally, after arriving at his residence, Ava hastily pushed Geralt through the door to his own home. After brushing off his enthusiastic thanks, she shut his front door, sealing him in his house. How does he even teach you? A lot of the time he doesn't, actually. But when he does, you'd be surprised how good he is. Anyway, let's go home. I'm exhausted. Dirk answered her question with a sigh. Ava nodded as she turned back from where they came, heading back home. The two walked in silence under the night sky. Along the way, Ava linked arms with Dirk, the two getting cozy with the other's warmth. Like that, they arrived at the house. Dirk went to open the door. When he did though, his hand froze a bit. That was only momentary though as he continued to turn the doorknob. Ah, home sweet home. And no sad musicians. Ava walked in with a tired groan, plopping down on the couch. Dirk hummed in response as he walked toward the kitchen. Ava watched him and realized there were still dirty dishes on the table. She pulled herself off the couch to help with the cleaning. However, when Dirk passed by the table, he suddenly moved. Ting! There was a loud ring. Ava was stunned as she saw a red knife in Dirk's hand. It was thrust out toward one of the chairs. Ho ho, aren't you sharp? A voice came from in front of Dirk. The next moment, a figure materialized in the chair Dirk had stabbed toward. The figure was holding its own knife, one that it used to block Dirk's strike. Suddenly, Ava felt her heart pound out of her chest. She realized something was happening as she saw that person cloaked in black. Dirk didn't wait long before attacking again. Slash. Ha! Dirk shouted after swinging his knife. Taking a step back, two magic circles suddenly appeared above the backs of his hands. With that, eight metallic arrows appeared above his head while four fireballs appeared around his body. Before attacking, he shouted. Ava! Get out of here! Wah! Ava couldn't seem to respond as she saw Dirk respond to this person in full force. She saw his face and its utter seriousness. She could even say he was flustered. She had never seen him like that before. He was always calm no matter the enemy. But this wasn't a normal enemy. In Dirk's eyes, he could sense an absurd power of darkness within this person. Dark mana shrouded their body, and through his initial strike he could sense strength beyond words. It didn't take long, but Dirk had already determined he couldn't fight against this person. Still, he responded with his full power. The reason was Ava. He couldn't retreat without her. The shrouded person chuckled at Dirk's violent response. A feminine voice escaped the black cloak. What's wrong, little boy? Afraid we'll hurt your girlfriend? Whoosh! Right after the cloaked woman spoke, Dirk responded with his prepared attacks. The arrows launched out at once, and the fireballs followed shortly after. Asterisk ting. 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 Ting, asterisk. With casual flicks of the wrist, the woman deflected every arrow despite them homing in at the same time. After that, her hand flew toward the fireballs. Before she could nullify them though, they exploded. Boom! Fire blasted out, filling the entire house. Seeing the approaching flames, Ava raised her arms and summoned her water mana to defend. 
The fire never came though. After the bright flames dissipated, Ava looked up. Dirk was in front of her. Snap into it. You need to get out of here. Now. Dirk yelled as he turned back to her. When he grabbed her arm, she shook a bit, nodding. All right. Let's go. Saying that, the two ran toward the door. When Dirk turned his back though, he felt a chill. Casting rock wall. Dirk barely even thought of the spell he wanted to cast before the AI responded. After a magic circle flashed, a rock wall was erected behind him. He grabbed Ava at the same time, pulling her to the ground. Zip! The next instant, a black arrow sailed over their heads. The rock wall was momentarily obliterated, sending rock fragments everywhere. Dirk popped to his feet, turning back around. You think you can run so easily? How naive. I thought you had properly judged my power for a second there. The woman stood from her chair. The fire had engulfed the entire kitchen and living room. The table, couch, and any other flammable items had already been destroyed. Only she and her chair remained, though even that chair disintegrated when she stood up. Still, she didn't have a single burn on her cloak. And that dark arrow was powerful. It had pierced straight through Dirk's rock wall without resistance, destroying it along the way as if it were a house of cards. The woman chuckled. First you walk in calmly as if nothing was wrong. Then you get close without giving the slightest hint that you know I'm here. Then, you launch a surprise attack. I commend your composure. I'd ask how you knew, but I'm not sure how much I care. Dirk was silent as the woman took steps towards them. After making an internal decision, his hand suddenly shot toward his neck. Oh, I don't think so. Before his hand could pound against his chest though, the woman flung out her hand. A chain extended out, one with a spike on the end. This spike flew faster than Dirk could keep up with, and it stabbed right into his arm. Ack! Dirk let out a pained grunt as the black spike impaled his forearm. After that, the woman pulled, yanking him forward. Dirk! Ava shouted as Dirk flew towards the woman. When he hit the ground though, his body entered a tumble, and he rolled to his feet right in front of the woman. Then, his other hand shot out. His red knife, one he had forged personally from Infernia, shuttled toward the woman's neck like a snake. Ting! The woman responded with her own knife though, blocking the sneaky attack. Dirk could see her smile from under her cloak. Skillful. I'd almost think you were properly trained if you weren't still a child. Whoosh! Dirk didn't respond, continuing to throw out attacks. Spikes, arrows, and fireballs constantly shot out at the woman while Dirk attacked with his knife. His body was fast, nimble, and cunning. He backed the woman into corners with every attack, each advanced chain with the next. It was skill that no child should possess. But the woman never faltered. She just swung her knife while spinning around, cutting down each and every attack. She seemed to dance with Dirk as the two made their way across the floor. But it never seemed like she was trying. Dirk was throwing all his strength and speed at this woman, but her hand was always sturdy when she blocked his attacks. It felt like everything he did was futile. It was a new feeling to him who had never fought someone with absolute strength. After several exchanges, Dirk also started to send his hand towards his neck again. The reason was due to the necklace on him. This necklace held a black marble, and it was the beacon his mother had told him to crush when he was in danger. Well, he was now in mortal danger, but he couldn't even crush it. Whenever he tried, the woman would yank her chain, jerking his body around. It had never actually come out of Dirk's arm, still impaled through his muscles and keeping him from using it. He tried to rip it out, but that put him in mind-numbing, paralyzing pain. When he fell to his knees due to this pain, the woman had merely laughed like he was some kind of joke. He couldn't get rid of the chain, and even when he tried to fall on the marble, using his chest to crush it, she would lift him back up. Nothing he did could set off that crucial alarm. It was obvious that she knew its function. When Dirk stood from his knees and started launching more attacks, she chuckled. My goodness. You're a tenacious one. 
let's see how long you can last. With those words, Dirk suddenly saw the woman vanish. The spike in his arm was suddenly ripped out. Ah! Dirk let out a rough scream. It felt like the spike tore out his nerves. His body felt weakness overcome it as blood streamed down his hand. Then, a fist came around, slamming into his back. Bang! Dirk's body slammed into the floor under this punch. When he forced himself back up, another fist drove itself into his stomach. He was lifted off the ground before falling. He coughed, blood spilling from his mouth. Still, he got back up. When he did, he was punched again. Each fist sent shockwaves through his body, and he was alerted by his AI about internal injuries. But that was only the appetizer. After fists came a knife, each slash opening large wounds across his body. Dirk's body was quickly soaked in blood. Still, he kept standing. He tried throwing back attacks with his rapidly dwindling strength, but none of it mattered. Then, there was suddenly a shrill cry. Get off of him! From upstairs, Ava came charging out with her axe. She had left when Dirk started getting attacked to retrieve her weapon, and the woman didn't bother with her. Now, with eyes filled with rage, she ruthlessly attacked the woman who was toying with Dirk. Of course, her slow axe couldn't hit its mark. The woman smiled at Ava's attempt, watching as her axe merely split the ground by her feet. Futile. But courageous of you. Oh, young love. How naive and stupid it can make people. Ah. Suddenly, Ava cried out in pain. Dirk's pupils contracted as he saw a wound open up on her hand. Stop. Or what? What will you do about it, Dirk Strider? The woman cackled as she continued. Ava let out cries as wounds opened up on her body. And these weren't normal slices either. Dirk had felt dark mana within each one, dark mana that caused excruciating pain. He could put up with it, but Ava couldn't. Ava collapsed after a mere five slices, tears streaming from her eyes. She was in so much pain, and she couldn't do anything about it. Dirk gritted his teeth. What do you want? You, Dirk Strider. Suddenly, the woman appeared in front of Dirk's face. Her hand grabbed his hair, yanking him upward until he looked into her eyes. How about it? Would you like to come with me? Fuck you. Wrong answer. Bam. The woman drove her fist into his stomach. As Dirk collapsed in on himself, the woman simultaneously grabbed his necklace, pulling it off his neck. She gazed at the black marble. So this is the warning beacon? Naive, so naive. And you? How stupid are you? You should have crushed this the moment you realized something was off. Thud. Ack. Dirk felt the wind escape his lungs as she ruthlessly kicked him. Despite the pain though, rage was brewing inside him. As the woman seemed to admire the marble, a feeble voice sounded. Get away from him. Ava barely stood and swung her axe again. Let alone casting magic as well, she barely had the mind to stand. Each movement sent waves of pain through her. The woman sneered as the axe missed her, hitting the floor. She didn't even move. Ava was just that out of it. Stupid. Crush. Raising her foot, the woman stomped down on the axe. The metal warped under her foot, directly folding in half before crushing the wooden floor underneath. Ava felt her heart sink as she fell to her knees. What was this freakish power? Ack. I'm going to kill you. You? Kill me? The woman smiled as Dirk stood up with hateful words. Despite the horrifying pain he was feeling, his eyes were determined. She just watched as he stood, sneering at his hopeless resistance. However, he quickly raised his arm afterward. She became curious about the item in his hand. It was a metal device, entirely black with a few glowing circuits along its body. From its handle extended a hollow barrel. Final stand weapon system deployed. It was his weapon system, a single pistol with a mere eight bullets inside. For years, 
Dirk had waited and waited as the Nainites within his body constructed this weapon piece by piece. It had long been completed, and now, Dirk was desperate enough to bring it out. Of course, the woman didn't know what this thing was. She just raised her eyebrows in curiosity. That was until Dirk pulled the trigger. Bang! There was a flash as an explosion rang out. Bang 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 bang. Seven more shots rang out after the first. Ava covered her ears as the sounds rattled her head. Dirk's eyes were glued to the woman. After firing every bullet within the gun, he lowered it. Bullet casings rattled on the ground by his feet for a second before silence prevailed. His face wasn't happy though. If anything, it was hopeless. The woman hadn't collapsed to the floor, and half the shots were placed on her forehead. Now that was interesting. She spoke as she raised her hand to her chest. After digging around, she pulled out a small chunk of metal. It was the bullet. A small little thing, yet so much power. It actually made me bleed a bit. Hey, what is that? The woman zipped over, grabbing the gun in Dirk's hand before kicking him away. He didn't even resist as he tumbled across the floor, stopping only when he slammed into the wall. The woman looked at the gun. However, after a few seconds, the glowing circuits on it flashed red. Ding! Boom! After a sound, the weapon suddenly exploded in her hands. Dirk watched as the weapon system was obliterated into nothing. This was a failsafe ensuring the technology of the weapon system couldn't fall into enemy hands. It also acted as a last resort, exploding with more power than a grenade. Dirk only lamented that all the time spent forming the weapon system was for nothing. He had thought of it as his last resort in dire situations. But as soon as he got into a truly dire situation, the enemy proved to be beyond even modern weaponry. Not even the explosion did anything. She had erected defenses in advance just in case there were any more surprises. Her instincts proved true. She stood there blankly for a second. Interesting. She spoke that one word. Then, she turned back to Dirk. Is that it? If it is, then it's time to finish up here. I can't have you lose too much blood. Saying that, the woman walked over and grabbed Dirk by the ankle. He was too weak to resist as he was dragged to the door. And no! Ava cried out as she saw the woman open the door. Hearing her, the woman turned before leaving. She smiled at Ava. Be thankful, little girl, that we're only after your precious boyfriend. You've avoided a descent into hell. Thank your weakness for that. With that, the woman turned and left. Ava trembled as they disappeared from view. No. No. Ah. Letting out a scream, Ava forced her body to stand. Her body screamed back at her, but she fought the horrifying pain. She dragged her body out of the house. Looking around, she couldn't see Dirk or the woman. After a few tears fell from her eyes, she turned in another direction. One foot in front of the other, she marched. She didn't know how long had passed, but she finally arrived outside of the Strider residence. With all her strength, she pounded the door. Strider. Mr. Strider. She screamed as hard as she could. Thankfully, only a few seconds passed before the door shot open. It was Cecilia, and she froze upon seeing Ava's bloodied body. Riker was right behind her, and his heart sank after instantly realizing what happened. No. He muttered as Ava fell to her knees. Durky. Someone attacked us. They took him. Cecilia was silent, but Ava was horrified as dark tendrils extended from her feet. Riker, who recovered quicker than his wife, quickly bent down and scooped Ava off the ground. Then, he turned to bring her inside. Before he could though, there was a shout. Striders. The noble Marquis, Riker Strider. The noble wife, Cecilia Strider. A random man approached the house, bottle in hand and words slurred as if drunk. He eyed the husband and wife who glared back at him. Cecilia, especially, had a terrifying gaze. He didn't seem faced in the slightest. Suddenly, the man's eyes sharpened. 
Azura sends his regards. Ah! With those words, Cecilia suddenly let out a shrill, soul-shivering scream. From her feet, black tendrils shot out in all directions. The ground was overturned as grass corroded and died. The already dark night turned even darker. At the same time, Cecilia's body changed as dark mana enveloped her. She turned ghostly, as if she were a wraith from hell itself. Without the man able to even react, she teleported in front of him. Her eyes had already turned pitch black, as if she were the abyss gazing into him. Where's my son? Ha ha ha. I don't even know. You think they would send someone who knew something? Ha ha ha. I'm going to rend your soul. With a voice that shouldn't belong to a human, Cecilia's hands dug into the man. His cackles turned into screams as his body was torn apart limb from limb. Then, with dark claws, she shot her hand into his head. There was a flash of light as her hand retracted. Above it was now a wisp, a colorful entity of light. It was a soul. Cecilia's two hands contracted around this soul, and within her grasp, screams were let out, ringing in the minds of others. These screams died out though as the soul disintegrated under her fingers. The light dissipated. Cecilia, who had turned into nothing short of a monster, took a few breaths before suddenly looking back at Riker. The man faced his wife, not scared or afraid of this horrifying form. The two seemed to communicate with their gazes. After Riker nodded, Cecilia turned. Taking a step, she disappeared like a true ghost. She was off to find her son. Riker gritted his teeth as his wife disappeared. He knew he couldn't do anything. This was her domain. It was her battle. Still, he hated it. With a heart full of silent rage, he turned and walked into the house. Ava had already passed out in his arms, though it was possible that Cecilia's monstrous form caused her to faint and not her exhaustion. He quickly went to treat her. This was all he could do. The night deepened with this small bout of chaos. Chapter 84 Stubborn After Cecilia in her monstrous form, she void walked to any place she could think of that Dirk would be taken. In fact, although she hated it, she had prepared for this eventuality. The entire month that Dirk had been living peacefully, she had been working herself to the bone. She made all kinds of preparations, one of which included killing any suspicious people who lingered around the academy. Of course, she didn't go killing indiscriminately. As her husband knew, she already had deep experience with these adversaries, so she could easily pick them out. And over the course of the month, she had killed close to thirty. Considering that each person was a trained assassin, this was an extremely high number. She also made sure to prepare contingencies. Things like alarm enchantments and trackers were placed all throughout the academy where Dirk was confined. If anyone went in or out, she would know about it. And yet, when Ava appeared on her doorstep, she realized it was all for nothing. There were no tripped alarms, nothing that indicated suspicious activity. This only meant that these assassins had been working ceaselessly to counter her efforts. So at this moment, in her rage, she did the only thing she could think of. She was brute forcing the problem. She searched everywhere, raising her senses to their absolute limits as she scanned Dirk's house and everywhere around it. This was when she caught a trail. The trail obviously led out of the academy. Because Ava was wounded, it took her time to arrive. Cecilia factored that in as she began following the trail. She shot out of the academy. She was a ghost as she void walked through the city. Soon enough, she exited the city, following a trail that went right over the city's walls. Then, from atop the walls, her eyes opened wide. She took in everything she could see. And in the distance about three miles away, there were faint dark mana fluctuations among a grove of trees. Without hesitation, she shot off the walls. And only a few seconds later, she appeared by the fluctuation. That was when she saw three people. There were two people that were cloaked, and one person who was held in the arms of a cloaked person. Cecilia knew instantly. It was Dirk. Dirk hadn't even noticed his mother before she moved. In her hands appeared a gray saber. 
The saber was shrouded in fog, almost as if it didn't have form. This was Cecilia's stigmata, a weapon formed from her soul. She instantly slashed towards the person holding Dirk, intending to take off their head. She didn't hold back any of her power. While she slashed, a dark domain was released, turning this space into one filled with her entire power. Spike chains also shot out from the ground, shooting toward the two cloaked people to lock them down. It was at that moment that the woman who was holding Dirk realized something was happening. But it was too late. She couldn't even turn her head before the saber drew close. But there was still another person there, and their head followed Cecilia's movements. Ting! Right before Cecilia could take a head, her saber was stopped. Dark power exploded from the collision, yet it didn't harm anyone. If anything, Cecilia was the one who got slightly injured as she felt the impact reverberate up her arm. Cecilia didn't care about the pain though. Upon being blocked, she momentarily froze. She looked at the weapon that blocked her with fearful eyes. A voice sneered. I see your power hasn't progressed in the slightest since you last threw a fit. Such a failure of an apprentice. Azura. Cecilia grit her teeth as she suddenly retreated. At the same time, the man who blocked her took off his cloak. A tall man, dressed in black with a strip of cloth covering his eyes. His presence was overwhelming. Cecilia had a hard time even looking at him. He was called Azura, nothing more. Cecilia was all too familiar with this man, and it was the reason desperation suddenly filled her heart. Why? Why must you do this? Why? I'm not inclined to explain my plans to a naive little girl. Shut up. I left. I got out. I didn't interfere with anything. Why must you come back and take my child? Cecilia screamed as her desperation erupted. It was clear that in front of this man, she couldn't fight. His power had once carved a deep scar within her. Azura just smiled. Why, your child is a rather rare specimen. He inherited the talent of you and your husband, and then more. No. That's not enough. You don't move on talent alone. Yes, you're right. It's not just his talent. It's your lack of it. Boom. Suddenly, Azura slashed out with his weapon. Cecilia raised her saber, barely blocking the attack. Her arms trembled as she bent down to bear the oppressive force. Azura snarled. You failed. You know that very well. Don't ask such stupid questions. I trained you to be the best, and you let your heart be clouded by happy little delusions. I should have killed you then, when you decided to marry a man you were supposed to kill. Ha! Huh. Even I don't understand where I went wrong. Slash. Azura swung his sword in fury. A blade of darkness was released, crashing into Cecilia. She grunted as she blocked it with all her power. But I don't care about you anymore. A failed apprentice, a failed harbinger. But in the end, it turned out all right. You created something with potential. And now, I'm going to do things right. No! Cecilia lashed out after hearing his words. Her saber came swinging, her body in attack seemingly disappearing as it moved. But Azura still blocked it. He blocked each one of the hundreds of attacks that rained down in only a few seconds span of time. At the same time, Dirk was watching from the side. After being dragged away by the woman, Dirk was put into some magical restraints. These restraints inhibited his mana and even his anima. He was made weak, no stronger than an adult man, and even that was only because of his trained muscles. Then, he was carried like baggage through the city before being taken into a forest. After the woman met up with the mysterious man, they began casting some complex magic. And that led them to now, when Cecilia arrived and interrupted things. At first, Dirk had been thrilled to see his mother. But when the mysterious man so easily blocked her, his heart sank. After that, he listened to their conversation, learning many important things. He looked at his panicked mother, feeling heartache at her helplessness. She was in his position when he had fought the woman. In front of absolute power, everything was futile. 
Of course, the power his mother displayed shocked him, but he didn't have the mind to worry about her hidden power. Because even that wasn't enough. He watched them fight. The pressure radiating from both of them made it hard for him to breathe, and the woman carrying him was also being stifled. She backed away as the two fought. Unfortunately, the fight didn't last long. After a mere minute, Cecilia was blasted away. He body was bloodied, her wounds clear under the moonlit surroundings. It didn't seem like what she did was completely useless though. The man, Azura, was now breathing roughly. Dirk wasn't sure if it was impressive that his mother could make this all-powerful existence break a sweat or impressive that the man was so powerful in the first place. Pa. Weak. It's as if you did nothing but tend to a fucking garden all these years. Truly, my greatest failure. But no matter. You're paying for your complacency now. Azura snarled as he turned toward Dirk. The woman straightened her back in front of him, and Dirk couldn't help but turn his head. The man's gaze, despite being covered, pierced through him and sent stabbing pains through his eyes. No. I'm. I'm going to hunt you down. I'll kill every Azure I find. I'll dismantle everything you've worked for. I may not be able to kill you, but I'll ruin everything you've built. Cecilia bellowed in rage. Azura just ignored her though, walking toward Dirk. He grabbed his hair, raising Dirk's head to meet his covered gaze. Your mother says these useless words, thinking she can threaten me. With you though, I hold her by the neck. Tell me, how does it feel knowing you're a burden to your mother? No. Dirk, don't listen to him. You'll never be a burden to me. You're my child. Heh, <sighs> more useless words. Reality shows the contrary to her colorful statements. Doesn't it, Dirk Strider? Azura smiled in Dirk's face as Cecilia struggled to even stand. He wanted to see Dirk's conflict. He wanted to see Dirk's image of his mother collapse. Quite the opposite happened though. Though Dirk was in pain, he faced Azura with a smile. Or, it was more like a derisive sneer. What, you want me to agree with you? Go fuck yourself, you blind piece of shit. Oh? We've got a stubborn one here. I'd say you got that from your mother, but she broke. Broke? She's here fighting you, making you pant like a fucking dog. I'd say you're pretty shit at breaking people if that's your standard. Dirk cackled a bit as he shot back, causing Azura to frown. The woman holding Dirk was also enraged. You will not speak in such a manner. Bang! Dirk! Cecilia shouted as the woman slammed Dirk into the floor. She was stunned as she heard laughing the next moment, though. Ha ha ha! What are you going to do, kill me? Dirk lifted his head and sneered at the woman. She trembled, about to attack him again, but Azura put up his hand. From their conversation, Dirk had come to understand one thing, he had value. This man wanted him, wanted his talent, and hoped to use him as a weapon. Naturally, this meant Dirk couldn't die. They wouldn't kill him, so all they could do was cause him pain. And if there was anything he was confident in, it was his pain tolerance. He had already been broken once. He wouldn't be broken again. Plus, Dirk was a different man now. They wanted to control him. As if. Dirk wouldn't become the dog he was in his past life. He'd rather die again. Azura realized this. Or, he realized that Dirk knew his position. But he wasn't flustered. He smirked at Dirk. Oh, don't worry, you naive boy. I might desire your talent, but make no mistake. I always get what I want out of the people I train. You cannot fathom what true pie dash dot. Spare me the fucking lecture. I've had enough of that from my teachers. Or is this what you call torture? Truly, I'm pissing my pants already. Maybe a bit more stubborn than I thought. Noted. Azura mumbled as he faced Dirk's maniacal smile. In those eyes, he couldn't see any fear. It was uncharacteristic of a young teen to have such eyes in the face of a hopeless situation. But Azura only thought that Dirk couldn't see the hell he would soon enter, so he didn't think anything of it. Azura wasn't the only one surprised. 
Cecilia was a bit shocked as she listened from the side. She had never seen this side of her son before. But it was a nice surprise. Cecilia clenched her fist. Her son had a strong will. He wouldn't succumb to Azure's manipulation. At least, not in the short term. What mattered was that she couldn't stop what was happening right now, but she could prepare for the future. Dirk's will would give her time. I'll come for you, Dirk. Even if it's the last thing I do, I'll save you from that hell. She vowed in her heart. Meanwhile, Azure motioned to the cloaked woman. She picked Dirk up off the floor, yanking him around to cause him as much pain as possible. We're done here. Saying that, the man suddenly brought out a device. Activating it, a black portal was created in front of him. He waved, and the woman turned to walk in. Dirk lifted his head. He and his mother locked eyes. As he crossed through the portal, he let out a smile. It wasn't bright or happy, but filled with an unrelenting spirit. While she wouldn't believe that he was capable of surviving the hell he was entering, it gave her hope. Hope that this wasn't the last time she would see the Dirk she knew and loved. Like that, he crossed through the portal. Azura glanced at Cecilia before also entering. The portal shut behind them, and the forest became silent. Ah! Cecilia let out a groan full of anguish. But she didn't cry or break down. She forced herself to stand. She had work to do, and she wouldn't stop until she saw her son again. With undying determination, she walked back to the city. The forest she left behind had long withered and died during the clash between two dark mages. Not even blood was left behind. Naturally, such a commotion would draw the attention of security forces. Guards from the capital city were quick to rush to the scene, but by that time, Cecilia was long gone. From that night onward, the Strider family was in a bit of disarray. After Cecilia returned from her battle, she collapsed in front of her husband. She had sustained horrible wounds, so on top of Ava, Riker tended to his wife. Thankfully, Riker was a rich man who had access to myriads of medicines. His wife was a dark mage and couldn't drink potions that were made with the light element. But he had potions made specifically for dark mages, powerful ones at that, so he didn't hesitate to use them. Ava was also tended to with expensive treatment. Of course, Riker had no thoughts about repayment. Ava was collateral damage in a situation she should never have been involved with. It was his obligation to help her. Like that, an entire day passed. It was then that both Cecilia and Ava woke up. When Ava woke, she gritted her teeth at the pain that filled her body, unable to even sit up in her bed. Cecilia was different though. She didn't hesitate to jump out of bed. Upon doing so, she downed an entire three potions. Her body was filled with the turbulent healing power of the potions, and for a while, she couldn't move. But when the potions settled, she had become quite a bit better. She had energy, and she could use her body and magic. That was enough for her. I'm going. And since she was healed enough, she went to leave. Riker stopped her though. Cecilia, you need to rest. No, I need to start working. Are you going to help me? Or are you going to coddle me? Cecilia's eyes bore into her husband's. She loved the man, but she now had an objective that took precedence over even her life. There was a reason Riker didn't help at all last night. It was because he wasn't suited for the work Cecilia did. Truth was, in a head-on battle, Cecilia wouldn't lose to her husband despite him being a tier 7. While she was only a tier 6, she was also a low rank 7. And all her power was focused on concentrated, singular attacks. She was an assassin, and she was very good at her job. Riker wasn't, though. He was a battle mage who had once fought in the Empire's military. He had earned his noble position through overwhelming power but his power wasn't concentrated. Fire and air. These were Riker's attributes. And in all the empire, he was the best at combining the two to wreak devastating, widespread damage. His attacks were on the level of natural disasters, capable of wiping out entire armies. But this mighty power was nothing in front of an assassin at the same level. 
so if it was direct help, Riker couldn't assist Cecilia much. But he could still assist her in other ways. He knew she needed to hunt people down. Well, he was a Marquis with many connections. In this situation, information was key, and he could provide it. He looked deeply at his wife for a bit before speaking. You know I'm going to help, so let's not make me the bad guy. But promise me that you'll work with me. He's our son, and you're not going to bear this alone. Understood? Yes. Good. It'll be all right. Riker hugged his wife after she quietly nodded. She seemed to calm down after a while, becoming a bit more rational. They could be anywhere, but Azura used a portal spell to move. For now, we'll confine our search to the Empire. As far as I know, he's based within the borders. I need you to talk to your friends in the military. The Fallen Azuras are a group that the Empire has been hunting for several dozen years. With their information, we can find a starting point. For now, I'll wait for this information. But don't make me wait long. Don't worry. I'll find one of my friends today. He won't object to the help. You go ahead and rest. And take care of Ava while you're here. I will. Now go. With that, Riker left the house, leaving Cecilia alone with Ava. Cecilia sighed before weakly walking toward the bedroom Ava was in. Are you awake? Yes. After Cecilia knocked on the door, she heard a small response. She entered, finding Ava curled on the bed. She had recovered some more after drinking some potions, but she was still weak. Not just physically weak either. She obviously wasn't handling the situation well. Cecilia went and sat on the bed. There was silence for a while, and it was actually Ava who spoke first. I'm weak. I need to get stronger. Strong enough to protect my friends. How do I do that? Ava lifted her head, turning to Cecilia. Her eyes were sorrowful but decisive. Her best friend had been taken, and she couldn't do anything about it. During that fight, she had been determined to kill that woman in order to save Dirk. But it was futile. After she woke up, instead of breaking down like a weak little girl, she steeled herself. She wasn't unlike Cecilia in this moment. Both were determined to do something about otherwise hopeless situations. Cecilia returned Ava's gaze, thinking for a second. I will take you to a friend of ours tomorrow. You train anima, but I highly doubt your manual is one of the good ones. We'll fix that. As for magic, well, depending on your technique and your progress, you likely aren't able to switch it. But we'll figure something out. After resetting your foundation, I will train you. It'll be a bit brutal, but, you don't care about that. Cecilia accurately gauged Ava's mental state. She was desperate for power, and Cecilia had no trouble giving that to her. Ava was the one by Dirk's side, and Cecilia was rather fond of this girl. She was willing to help Ava reach her goals, or at the very least put her on the right path. With her willingness to help, Ava's face softened a bit as she nodded. With that, their goals were set. Meanwhile, Dirk had just begun fighting his own battles. Chapter 85, Hell After Dirk was brought through the portal, he reappeared in a dark space. He had been smiling at his mother as he was brought through, but as soon as they disappeared, the smile was wiped off his face. Now, he looked around with a ruthless gaze. The room they were in held a portal, but they quickly walked out of this room into another area. At first glance, it looked like a massive cave. The ceiling was nearly 100 meters high and the walls had tunnels that led to other areas similar to an ant colony. This seemed to be the central hub for this underground settlement, and there were stone buildings all along the ground and even some on the walls. Welcome to hell. The woman snickered as they walked into this hub. Along the way, Dirk looked around and saw cloaked adults and uncloaked teenagers. The teenagers all had either fearful or numb expressions and the adults had either angry frowns or insidious smiles. There were crowds of people, enough to fill a town at first glance. Of course, as they walked down a street, all eyes were pulled to Azura and Dirk. Dirk especially. The cloaked adults all grinned at him as if he were fresh prey, 
and the teens glanced at him with pitiful or resentful eyes. Dirk just kept his gaze forward. Soon enough, they actually arrived at an open clearing. It was almost like a town square. Except, in the center of this town square was a lifted stone platform. Dirk was a bit shocked when he saw a metal pole with chains sticking out of the platform, and frowned when he saw the red and black streaks that dyed the stone a sinister color. It was blood. You know what to do. Of course. After Azura spoke, the cloaked woman nodded with a smile. She threw Dirk onto the platform before walking over and chaining him to the pole. It was only his hands that were chained. Then, Azura went up to him and inspected his body. Dirk had already lost his Infernia knife, but he still had a pocket ring on him. Azura took it off his finger, inspecting it. Just some supplies? Poor bastard. What, you actually thought I'd keep valuable items in that thing? How stupid are you? Dirk sneered at the man. When this was heard though, all the surrounding people who were still walking stopped. They all turned toward the platform. From behind, the woman spoke. Watch your words, little boy. You think I was just sitting in your house doing nothing? Feast your eyes. Suddenly, the woman waved her hand. In front of Dirk appeared some books. His eyes widened. It was his mana and anima training manuals, along with the stolen books Geralt had given him. The dwarf's book wasn't there since Dirk had returned it after some time, thankfully. For a moment, Dirk panicked. They had a hold on books that were the key to his future advancement. But suddenly, he remembered his AI. I already got everything up until tier and rank 5. Thankfully I focused on analyzing those runes. Interface, I love you. Dirk smiled inwardly. Outwardly though, he was frowning. Azura finally smiled seeing his distress. That's right. I think I hold your future in my hands now. You want to advance? Think long and hard about whether you obey me or resist me. Let's not worry about that right now though. Delia, go ahead and start. All right. Wait, Delia. After the woman cheered with sinister intent, Dirk perked up in astonishment. This woman, she had the same name as the one who dumped Geralt. The woman clearly saw Dirk's astonishment and smiled. Recognize that name? I'm sure taking care of that depressed idiot was awfully exhausting. In the end though, I had to suffer for a year as that man begged like a dog just to take me to dinner. Ugh. He's as disgusting as his fashion sense. Still, he was at least a bit useful. A bit of information feeding, and not only did he steal some spell books, but I was able to take out the academy's alarm formations. What an idiot. Delaha sneered as she recalled her manipulations. Dirk found himself enraged. You conniving bitch. Geralt was a happy man before you. Yeah. A bit too happy for anyone's taste. Deliha. Suddenly, Azura shouted. Deliha instantly went silent before bowing. I'm sorry, master. No more chatting. Give this stubborn child some physical education. Right away. As Azura took the books, Deliha retreated behind Dirk. Looking around, Dirk could still see crowds of people silently watching him. In fact, it seemed like everyone in the vicinity had stopped to watch. It was eerie. Azura smiled as he turned to the crowds. See this, child? They're all here to watch you suffer. This is law in this place. All peoples are to stop their activities and watch when someone is receiving physical education. This way, they remember why bowing their heads is the correct decision. Physical education? What are you, a clown? Just call it torture. No need to be stupid, dumbass. Dirk jeered at Azura, causing him to frown again. He turned and looked at Deliha behind Dirk. Deliha. Level 3. Of course. With a nod, Deliha turned. On the back of the stone platform were ten pedestals. Each one of them held a whip. At Azura's words, Deliha went to the third pedestal and grabbed the whip. Take his shirt off. Azura spoke after Deliha brandished the whip. 
Dirk smiled again. Stripping me? At least take me to dinner first. Keep laughing while you can. You may never do so again. Azura spoke simply before walking away. As he disappeared into the crowd, there was suddenly a crack. Slash. Suddenly, Dirk felt something tear at his back. It was the whip. And after it swiped across Dirk's skin, his pupils contracted. Ah. Dirk let out a low scream as his body was suddenly jolted with pain. It was unlike anything he had ever felt before. No gunshot, stab, or broken bone could compare to the nerve-rending pain this whip sent through him. The smile was immediately wiped off his face, and he fell to his knees. Blood immediately streamed down and soaked his torn shirt. But there was no rest before another crack graced his ears. Whack! Arg! Crack! Ag! Deliha had a bright smile as she swiped out with the whip several times in a row. Each time, Dirk felt my numbing pain shoot through him. Obviously the whip was special, meant for delivering massive amounts of pain. Dirk already knew that dark magic could be infinitely more painful when used to wound people. But now, he was directly experiencing that for himself. The whip had a leather tail on it that was equipped with dozens of small nails. These nails scraped and gouged his skin. Deliha didn't stop at his back either. Occasionally the whip would wrap around his body, slicing his abdomen, arms, or shoulders. He was mutilated by the whip that Della was more than happy to repay his snobby words with. What's wrong? Why aren't you laughing anymore? Where did those snide remarks go? Della shouted in building rage as she continued to whip Dirk. He continued to cry out, the pain going so far as to pierce his mind. He already slumped down, his arms raised as they were chained to the pole. Everyone in the town square watched with blank faces, except for the adults who were smiling. They had all heard Dirk's rebellious retorts, but all that was gone now. Now, he was only letting out horrible cries from the whip. It was a scene they had seen too many times as evidenced by the red stone dyed by the blood of countless others. Only, this lesson in physical education didn't continue for long. Eventually, Dirk's shirt was turned into nothing but scraps, revealing his entire upper body. This was what Azura meant by taking his shirt off. And once his blood began to soak the stone underneath, Deliha finally stopped. She had already wounded him from their fight earlier, and she knew that she couldn't kill him. She was even surprised that Azura had told her to use the level 3 whip. But she was satisfied by the suffering she inflicted. For now at least. She would have to wait for her next opportunity. After gazing at Dirk's collapsed body, she shouted. Hurry up and get this thing out of my sight. He needs to be completely fixed for the next time we do this. With her words, two men suddenly ran up and unchained Dirk. By his arms, they dragged him to another area in the cave. After he disappeared, the surrounding people went back to what they were doing. Nobody spared a second glance at the stone platform. Ugh. After an unknown amount of time, Dirk, who had passed out not long after the whipping, began to regain consciousness. He was currently on a stone bed just big enough for a body. It seemed this place had a twisted sense of what a hospital bed was supposed to be. At first, Dirk wanted to pop right off of the stone bed, but he quickly found his body chained down by his wrists and ankles. He merely pulled on his wrists a bit, feeling the abnormal strength of the metal that held him. Obviously, normal metal couldn't be used to restrain body refiners. With that, he didn't bother resisting. Instead, he turned inward. Interface. Status. Fourteen hours have passed. Current bodily state, 94% healthy. Minor internal injuries still present. 100% combat capable. Dirk watched as his AI assessed his injuries. Thinking for a moment, Dirk did indeed feel oddly well considering he was close to dying after the whipping. They must have healed me. Break me down, build me up, rinse and repeat. That's torture 101. Dirk sighed a bit. Still, he couldn't help but remember the mind-tearing pain the whip caused. When he thought about it, he could feel his back sting. It was like phantom pain. 
When this happened though, Dirk gritted his teeth. No. I will not be traumatized by them. Pain is nothing more than just pain. I can't show any weakness. He tried to harden his mind. At that time though, a man walked over. Dirk's face went blank as he saw him. He looked like a doctor, but not a good one. Strapped to the fingers of his right hand were scalpels of various shapes and sizes. His clothes were covered in dried bloodstains, and on his eye looked like a magnifying monocle. His skin was wrinkly like a withered old man, and his left hand constantly shook oddly. Just looking at him, Dirk knew he was a psycho. Oh, you're awake. Ah, let me see your skin. That beautiful skin. When the man realized Dirk was awake, he hastily shuffled over. Dirk tried to retreat as his hand began to trace his arm and exposed chest. Ha! Hoo! Truly, I've never seen skin quite like this. Not even the girls have skin like yours. It's smooth and firm, so pleasing the touch. Get your hands off me. As the man spoke dangerous words, Dirk let out a low growl. The man just ignored him though as he focused on Dirk's skin some more. Thankfully, it wasn't long before someone suddenly walked into the room. It was a cloaked man, and he immediately laid eyes on Dirk. Fingers. I need the kid. Ah, pity, a pity. Do be sure to send him back quickly. I doubt it'll be long if he keeps the attitude. The man snickered. At the same time, the doctor named Fingers walked off to another table where another body was unconscious. He was disturbed as Fingers began feeling the skin of a boy. A very good reason to never fall unconscious here ever again. Dirk made a silent vow as the man began to unchain him. First were Dirk's arms, and once both were freed, Dirk suddenly shot his hand out, grabbing the man's arms that went to grab a restraint. After getting a hold on him, Dirk pulled with his full strength. Anima was burned as he twisted the man's arm. Or, when he tried to twist it. Ha! Huh. I was told you might struggle. The man smiled a bit after activating his own strength. Then, Dirk was overpowered as he was slammed into the stone bed. Cough! Dirk grit his teeth as he tasted blood in his mouth. However, he wasn't yet done. Suddenly, a metallic spike surged from the ground. It slammed into the man's thigh, and this time, the man couldn't handle it so well. Ack! He grunted as the spike pierced into his thigh. After that, Dirk threw out a punch, his knuckles slamming into the man's jaw from below. He went tumbling to the floor. With that, Dirk concentrated on the shackles around his ankles. Feeling the metal mana within him, he filled the shackles. Then, using the knowledge he was taught while forging, he bent the metal using his mana. Creak! The metal barely warped after Dirk poured his energy into the mana. He felt a sharp pain pierce his head, but he ignored it as he pulled the shackles off his ankles. Then, he looked at the man who was kneeled down with his pierced thigh. After bringing back his foot, he kicked out. Bam! His heel slammed into the man's nose, causing blood to spray. Dirk then jumped off the bed and ran out of the room. He didn't even spare a glance at the panicked doctor fingers. After exiting the room in nothing but shorts, he looked around. He had entered a tunnel with only one direction to go. Without hesitation he ran through, quickly coming upon the exit. By the exit though were two cloaked guards. These two guards quickly noticed Dirk, but by that time, he had already taken the initiative. He cast more magic, five metallic arrows appearing around him. These arrows hurled forth at the guards while he charged. They raised their own magic though, blocking all the arrows with wind and dark magic before pulling out knives. Dirk jumped at one man just as he pulled his knife. He didn't dare to bet that they wouldn't stab him since they could heal him afterward anyway. So using more magic in his oppressive strength, he bombarded the man with swift fists. Only, he quickly realized that the guard was much stronger than he thought. The guard didn't even flinch as Dirk drove his fist into his face. Ha! Huh. Weak! With a snicker, the guard threw his own punch. It was fast, and Dirk couldn't dodge it. The fist slammed into his side. Crack! 
Dirk was shocked as he felt two of his ribs break. He coughed out blood as the wind was knocked out of his lungs. As if he didn't feel pain though, Dirk dodged the hand that was about to grab him, tumbling out of the tunnel. Then, he took off into a sprint, running into the central town. Dirk looked around as he jumped on top of a building, the two guards right on his tail. He barely began to breathe again, but his face was apathetic as he scanned the surrounding terrain. Where would the exit to this place be? Maybe the portal? Thinking that, Dirk shot off into another direction. Dirk's AI rapidly created a map of the place from what he saw, so he was able to remember the location of the portal. The guards shouted as he used all his strength to run. Dirk's body flew across and between buildings. He ran across walls, tumbled through tight holes, and scaled tall stone structures. He had the balance of a gymnast and the skill of a parkour expert. Like that, he was able to maintain distance from the two guards who didn't wish to cause too much damage to the surroundings just to catch him. But they weren't his only enemies. As he ran through the town, all the cloaked adults walking around naturally saw him and heard the shouts of the guards. Since something interesting was happening, they didn't hesitate to join in the chase. Soon enough, Dirk had over a dozen cloaked assassins on his tail. He even got into scuffles, but he slipped through them quickly in order not to get surrounded. Like that, he eventually ended up outside the door to the portal. With all his strength, Dirk rammed the door, blasting through. When he did, he was shocked to see no portal of any kind. The only thing he saw was Della, and she was casually sitting on a chair in the middle of the empty room. Wow. He told me you would arrive here. Turns out you can be read like a book. Della stood with a sneer. She then shot out her hand, her spike chain hurtling toward Dirk. He couldn't dodge, and the spike pierced into his shoulder. Dirk let out a groan when the spike seemed to sear his nerves, but he wasn't one to easily give up. He ran backward with the spike inside his shoulder, casting all the spells he could to hurt Delia. His free hand also grabbed the chain, and he went to pull it out. But it was as if the spike was glued to his body. The only thing he felt was pain as he pulled harder and harder, and when he was yanked forward, he couldn't resist. Delia huffed as Dirk landed in front of her feet. She pulled the chain again, lifting him up. Then, she took out a knife and drove it into his stomach, brutally twisting it. When blood dripped onto her hand, she threw him away. She chuckled as Dirk struggled to even breath. Really? Fighting when you know it's useless? Rip! Ack! Dirk cried out a bit as the spike chain tore out a chunk of his shoulder. She then walked over and grabbed his leg, dragging him out of the room. When she exited, she saw a dozen cloaked men surrounding the doorway. Her gaze swept over them all. Mph, useless. Couldn't even catch a child, huh? Does that mean I should bring out the whips for all of you? Fuck. Bring him to the platform. Yes ma'am. The men all shouted before one of them ran over and grabbed Dirk. Then, he was quickly dragged to the stone platform before being chained up again. He kneeled as blood streamed down his stomach. Twenty lashes. Level three. Yes. When Delia gave the command, one of the men grabbed the level three whip. Crack. The whip shot forth, creating red streaks on Dirk's back. He cried out as his body seemed to fail him. Every single time the whip came down, Dirk's voice echoed out into the ears of everyone who stopped to watch. At some point though, Dirk let out a roar. Ah. Fuck you. You can't break me. He screamed, and when the next whip came down, he sealed his mouth shut. Grunts escaped between his gritted teeth, but he refused to let himself cry out like a child. Still, the pain was horrific. When the twentieth lash came down, Dirk had collapsed. His body was finished, especially after being blatantly stabbed by Delia. Delia frowned. Take him to fingers. Hurry up. Yes. With her word, Dirk was dragged away like a corpse. Once he disappeared again, the surrounding people went on their way. Meanwhile, Azura watched from above. With a huff, he turned away, going back to business. In time, you naive child. 
Chapter 86 Situation Slash Rest Dirk was taken to fingers for the second time in a day's time. Of course, the mad doctor was thrilled to see this. Here, here, let's get potions inside you. Can't have that wonderful skin of yours remain destroyed. Fingers grabbed a bag and a needle as he spoke with a jittery voice. It looked like he administered potions through something similar to an four drip. After all, unconscious people couldn't drink potions. Dirk wasn't unconscious though. Although it was sooner than he thought, he was making true on his vow to never sleep while in the presence of Fingers. When he saw Fingers about to stab him with those shaky hands, he shouted. Get, away from me. Give me, the bottle, damn it. He cursed between breaths. He was so weak that the guards didn't even need restraints to hold him down. Seeing as how Fingers ignored him though, he glared at the man. Hey! Stab me with that needle, and the next time I get out of here, I won't bother trying to escape. I'll come straight for you. Quiet! Suddenly, one of the guards smacked Dirk across the face. Fingers clearly hesitated though. He didn't hesitate for long, however. After Dirk was chained down, he stuck the needle into his arm. Ack! Dirk grunted and looked over. The needle didn't even go into the vein. Fingers' shaky hand missed and hit his muscle instead. Seeing this, Fingers pulled out the needle before trying again. But he still missed, and Dirk was baffled as he retried. Like that, Dirk was stabbed five times before the needle went into the vein. Moments later, Dirk felt a refreshing liquid stream through his body. His wounds healed at a visible rate, and even his energy was slightly restored. Of course, Dirk wasn't one to just let things happen. Interface, isolate that potion. Save the excess for later. Affirmative. With that command, the nanites in Dirk's body began to grab and store the potion streaming into his veins. It took control by distributing the potion to urgent injuries, making efficient use of it before storing some for later. This happened across the course of about eight hours. The potion didn't stream into him all at once. He was given ample time to heal, and the drip bag was replaced twice. Dirk was a bit baffled by the expenditure. This was obviously an expensive potion, yet these people were giving it to him. He really does value my talent. But what the hell does he plan on doing anyway? Dirk began to wonder about Azura's motives. After a few seconds though, he shook his head. That wasn't what he should be caring about right now. The portal is no longer there. I need to find where the exit is. But. I don't have the power. I'm still weak. I need to bid my time. From the looks of it, this isn't just some kind of torture dungeon. I need to get a grasp on the situation. Dirk made his decisions in his mind. It was impossible to fight his way out when he didn't know where out was. All the adults were also more powerful than him, and he only had his bare hands and magic to fight with. So he decided that he wouldn't go running around like a headless chicken. On the stone bed, he let out a long breath. Despite his previously splitting headache, Dirk kept himself awake for the entire eight hours that he was on the stone bed. By that time, he had mostly healed. The stab wound had completely sealed while his skin had turned pink after healing from the whipping. Still, he had some injuries that would take a bit longer to heal, and he was tired. Unfortunately, that was also the time when someone came to get him. Wakey wakey! Are you thinking about trying to run again? I wouldn't mind if you did. Then I'll be able to whip you. Delahoe walked over to his stone bed, chuckling at his restrained body. Unlike previously though, Dirk no longer looked at her with enraged eyes. He was now apathetic, as if nothing mattered. Delia clicked her tongue seeing that. She had fun whenever Dirk tried to resist and was brutally beaten down by her. Mph. Finally whipped some sense into you? Good. Because thanks to Azura's benevolence, your life isn't going to be nothing but torture. Unshackle him. With her word, a guard came and undid Dirk's restraints. Surprisingly, he didn't bother to put mobile restraints on. Dirk didn't question why though. Deliho was right here. He couldn't do anything in front of her. 
Follow. Deliha waved before walking out. Dirk stood there for a second, and when he was finally shoved forward by the guard, he began walking. He followed Deliha through the tunnel and out into the town. Upon arriving on a wide street, Deliha turned back and looked at Dirk, her arms raised. See all the buildings around you? There's a rule here that there's no such thing as inherent possession. If you want something, you take it by force. If you want to keep something, you better be able to defend it. This goes for everything from your clothes to your residence to any items you receive. Of course, not all the items in circulation are borrowed goods. There's currency here and a place to buy things. The only rule here is that there is no killing. You can beat someone within an inch of their life, but you aren't allowed to take it, and aren't allowed to let them die from the aftereffects of your work. After all, you are now property. We aren't keen on losing our investments. If you're found to have killed someone or let someone be killed, you will be subject to a month of physical education. Della chuckled as she explained. Dirk listened quietly and quickly understood the nature of this place. It was the law of the jungle here. If you were weak, you'd have everything taken from you, even the clothes on your back. While you would still live in the end, it would be a hellish life. You'd be worse off than a homeless man in the streets of a city. Not even getting treated was pleasant. There was the Dr. Fingers who was as creepy as creepy gets. Going there meant dealing with him, and even Dirk would make sure he wouldn't have to go if he could help it. Other than that, there are two things that go on in this place. Every one of you little azures in training are required to take lessons. And every month, there are evaluations. There are rankings that score you based on your performance in the evaluations. And of course, there's the arena where battles take place every three months. Everyone must fight in these battles. Nothing is optional. And to incentivize good performance, people who don't live up to standards are given extra physical education. Those that do good are handed currency, allowing a bit more luxury in this place. Dirk was silent. It seemed like there was a kind of hierarchy in this place, and competition was definitely fierce. After giving out that basic information, Delia went on to take Dirk on a small tour. She went through several tunnels, showing Dirk where all the lesson areas he would be taking were. There were some lessons for pure learning, but most were taught by example. They taught everything from stealth to killing to protocol. This was a place that trained assassins, so it was natural they taught all these things. Dirk was actually surprised though when he saw how much effort was going into this place. He was able to get a glimpse into the nature of this entire endeavor. It was an organization. While there was plenty of torture and brainwashing, it still had a purpose, and it needed people to achieve goals. If they just whipped their people all day, there wouldn't be any competent underlings. There had to be incentive, a reason to improve and obey. They'll train me. But they'll also ensure that I will be working for them. There will come a time when I will do things without their supervision. But they won't let me until they can trust that I've been assimilated, and I will not do what they want me to. So I need to escape, but I need power for that. Dirk came to this conclusion. The only variable was time. How long would it take him to gain power, and how long could he last? Dirk knew that given enough time, there were very few that couldn't be broken, or at least affected and twisted. How long would it take? A week? Months? Years? He didn't know. It all came down to how he adapted to this place and how hard they tested his tolerance. After being taken to all the lesson areas and given a schedule that he needed to follow, Dirk was taken back to the town. Then, Delia came up to him and grabbed his forearm. He resisted a bit, but she could easily control him with her strength. Rank 6? Probably. Dirk guessed her rank as she brought out an item. It was a black metal band with a black crystal embedded in its center. She slapped this metal band on his right forearm, and it clamped down. Ack! Dirk suddenly felt a searing pain that seemed to melt into his bones as the metal heated up. The black metal turned to liquid and extended from his wrist to his elbow. It even sunk into his skin as it formed something like a runic formation. After several seconds, 
the metal band had turned into a runic enchantment that branded his arm like a tattoo. The black crystal had also formed itself into a shape in the middle of his forearm. Dirk looked at the tattoo. Other than the runes he couldn't understand, there was a large infinity loop in the middle. It was a number eight. Congratulations. You are no longer the noble child, Dirk Strider. You are now Harbinger Eight. Eight. Dirk mumbled, the corner of his mouth twitching a bit. Could there be such coincidences? Delia smiled. Anyway, that's all I have for you. You're on your own now. And do be sure to perform well. Or don't. I'll personally be carrying out any of your physical education, so it's fine with me if you slack off for a while. With a small chuckle, Della waved and walked off with her guards. Dirk was left in nothing but a pair of shorts, standing in the middle of a street. So I need to fend for myself, huh? Everything from my clothes to a house. Dirk frowned as he looked around. He had already memorized his schedule, and there were clocks all around the town to track time. Since there was no light in this place other than the artificial lamps everywhere, one couldn't track time by the sun. Dirk had his AI though, so that wasn't a problem. Either way, he didn't start anything until tomorrow, or fourteen hours from now. Truth was, Dirk wanted to sleep more than anything. He had been up for nearly ten hours, and all of it was spent recovering from a nasty headache and horrible wounds. His body and mind were exhausted. And while Dirk would prefer a house, he wasn't interested in fighting anybody for one right now. Thinking that, he turned and walked off between some buildings, avoiding the curious gazes coming from all around. The town was a large area within the massive cave, composed entirely of stone buildings, walls, and structures. There were small and large living spaces, some of which were like apartments and others that were like proper houses. The houses were on the outskirts of the town while the more compact apartments were in the center. There were even houses that were built up the walls of the cave. These ones had large staircases leading to them and windows that were lit. It seemed pretty luxurious, and Dirk guessed that only the most powerful lived there. Not wishing to attract trouble, Dirk made his way to an alley between some deeper apartment buildings. When he found a clean patch of dirt that he could sit on and a wall to lay against, he walked over. He didn't sit though. He stared at the dirt, and his heart rate suddenly went up as his body felt weak. He fell to his knees. Perhaps it was because he was finally alone, but all the stress that built up since he was taken came crashing down all at once. And not the physical stress either. He clutched his chest as he breathed roughly, feeling a deep pain inside of him that didn't come from any wound. Ack! Ha! Ha! Damn! I really thought I had it for a while there. I was actually satisfied with myself, with my half-decent life. You'd probably call me a dumbass if you heard that, huh Gray? You'd say that I'd become complacent, that I need to get my ass up and run another mile. Dirk chuckled hollowly as he hunched over, falling onto his side. He seemed to curl up like a child, feeling weaker and weaker every second. It was such a foreign feeling. But. I don't know if I want to anymore. It hurts, Gray. I'm sorry. I just wanted to have some fun. I had a friend in everything. Why? Why did this have to happen? At least I had you last time, but I'm alone now. Can I just rest? Is that okay? Dirk's eyelids drooped as he mumbled. Like that, he passed into a deep slumber while curled in on himself. And while he turned unconscious, a sinister pair of abyssal eyes locked in on Dirk from the ocean of mana around him. The Dark Element Incarnate. That colossal being slowly inched towards Dirk, not attacking, but keen on taking that pure soul for itself. It waited, delightful over the weakness that its prey was exposing. So delightful, despair. Thirteen hours passed as Dirk slept. For him who was far beyond ordinary humans, sleeping for such a long time was as out of place as it was concerning. And he would have slept longer if not for an untimely interruption. Proximity chatter detected. Dirk's eyes slowly began to open at the alert of his AI. Since it was chatter he was alerted about, Dirk's ears automatically perked up while the AI isolated some sound. 
Is he the new one? Yeah, the Harbinger. I saw him come in here and fall asleep. It's been a long time since then, so he might be awake. H. Hey, I hear he got the bloody mistress on his ass. He's quite the unlucky one. He's Harbinger 8 though. 8 is lucky, right? Fortune's fool. Why does Silky want to hurt him though? That's none of your concern. Just get ready. After Dirk listened in on the chatter, three people suddenly appeared at the entrance to the alley he was in. His eyes closed for a moment. Lucky. He sighed inwardly as he turned over. His face was blank, as if he didn't care about the three people who sneakily approached him. They looked to be older teenagers, perhaps sixteen or seventeen years old. Go away. Dirk mumbled just loud enough for them to hear. They were momentarily surprised that he detected them so easily, but got over it as they smiled. The leader of the three looked at Dirk who lay on the floor like a homeless man with his back turned to them. He was in nothing but shorts, so his body was dirted by dirt, dust, and residual dried blood from his healed wounds. The leader walked over next to Dirk. When he did, he caught a glimpse of the large number eight on his forearm. It caused him to frown momentarily before he snickered at Dirk's pitiful appearance. A harbinger sleeping like a dog? That's a first. Hey! I have a message from Silky that I was personally tasked with delivering to you. You probably have no idea who that is, so all I'll say is that she's someone you can't defy. I suggest you climb to your feet and receive the message. Dirk didn't respond at all, causing the leader to frown. He growled and brought his leg back. Hey! I'm telling you to stand up. Whoosh! He kicked out his leg with full force, aiming right for Dirk's back. At that moment though, Dirk threw out his elbow. The two collided. Crack! With Dirk aiming at a weak spot on the leader's shin bone, it wasn't he who gave out. The leader felt waves of pain overcome him as his bone folded around Dirk's elbow, snapping in half. Ah! He yelled as he fell backward, clutching his broken leg. The other two, enemy two and enemy three, rushed forward to attack. Dirk slowly began to get to his feet as they approached. While he was hunched over, Enemy 2 stepped forward and swung out his own leg backed by large amounts of anima, intending to kick Dirk in the face. Dirk activated his own anima though and threw out his palms, stopping the leg and grabbing it. After grabbing his leg, Dirk kicked out Enemy 2's other leg, making him fall on his back. With him on the floor, Dirk used his foot to step on his chest and his arms to put his leg into a hold. Enemy 2's knee was quickly put into a lock, causing him to feel a wave of chills. No, why dash? Crack! After Dirk used a bit more strength than normal, the knee that Enemy 2 had attempted to reinforce with Anima was bent the wrong way. Dirk dropped the leg as he started letting out loud screams of pain, turning his attention to Enemy 3. Enemy 3 was actually casting fire magic. Dirk didn't even move as he cast Rock Wall in front of him. At the same time, a fireball shot out from Enemy 3. It was a concentrated fireball, and it collided with the metallic stone. Boom! The wall exploded under the fireball, but Dirk had already raised his arm. And it was a small shield of rock, more than enough to block the debris from hitting him. Dust was kicked up, causing Enemy 3 to squint his eyes. As he searched for Dirk though, he felt a piercing pain in his leg. Rock Spike Dirk cast this magic, and the spike shot right through Enemy 3's leg. He let out a small scream, barely keeping on his feet and hastily trying to lift his leg out of the spike. He couldn't though since the spike was pointed upward, keeping him from just sliding his leg out. Ack! At this moment, the leader gritted his teeth and pointed his hand. Dirk turned and saw a magic circle of the dark element. To this, Dirk just cast another rock wall. The next moment, Dirk saw black tendrils wrap around the wall, crushing it directly like an angry squid. They then charged toward him, though they were weakened. Dirk cast another spell, a simple fireball. This fireball was instantly created and shot toward the tendrils, exploding and engulfing them in flame. There was a momentary flash before the flames quickly died down. 
With the flames, the tendrils were snuffed out. Dirk calmly walked over as the leader tried to cast another spell and swung his foot. Crack! His foot buried itself into the leader's side, breaking two ribs. The leader cried out, and the spell failed to cast. After that, it was enemy two that tried to stand back up and fight. It didn't look like he was a mage, and Dirk was able to easily put him back on the floor. Then, when enemy three tried to cast another fire spell with the spike still in his leg, Dirk cast another rock spike, the spike shooting through his arm this time and interrupting the spell. With that, all three enemies were incapacitated. The entire time, Dirk didn't have the slightest change in expression. His eyes were still dull, even a little sorrowful. I. I didn't want to fight. I just. Why did you have to come here? Should I take you to Fingers now? I can't let you die, after all. As if you were a merciful caregiver, Dirk suddenly walked over and grabbed each person, throwing one over his shoulder and dragging two by their arms. Like that, he walked all the way to Fingers, though he had to dish out some more punishment to the rowdy bunch along the way when they got angry. Chapter 87, 50 Lashes The three messengers were terrified as they were dropped in Fingers' medical room. Dirk was right. Going to Fingers truly was dreadful for everyone. Upon arrival, Fingers was actually a bit wary of Dirk who had previously made a vow to come for him. He was surprised though when Dirk brought three customers. Here you go, Fingers. Maybe I'll have some more for you later. Who knows? With those words, Dirk walked out under the vigilant gazes of the guards. Fingers rubbed his chin before his eyes gleamed and looked at the three boys. They all began to beg and pander seeing that gaze, terrified of what was to come. Dirk didn't turn back as he walked out, even when he heard screams. After leaving, he went back to his spot in the alley, laying down on the dirt once more. Like that, he stared off into space. Although he felt hunger and thirst set in at that moment, he didn't seem to care. Instead, he began to contemplate. I don't want to be here. I just want to go home. To Mother and Ava. I don't want to be whipped. It hurts so much. I don't want to have to keep hurting so much. I escaped one hell and was thrown into another. They will never allow me to escape again. If it's not one thing, it's another. There's always more pain waiting. Will I ever be free? Is that too much to ask? Are two lives not enough? Dirk felt his chest hurt. Gone was the person he was only a day ago. After being thrown into this dark place, old wounds began to surface memories he would have preferred to never remember. He could see his past life on earth. Being snatched out of the slums, an orphan with no place to call home. He was thrown into a place of brutal training and reformation. He was beaten down and turned into a machine. Dirk wasn't the only one. There were plenty of others right beside him. But they disappeared one after the next. Year after year, the ones he came to know went away. Many died, others failed the program. At some point, Dirk became so good that he advanced ahead of all others, and from then on he was mostly alone. But there was always one person there. Gray, his sergeant. The one man who didn't just break him, but guided him. Speaking words of wisdom and experience, he taught Dirk as if he were his own son. He taught him how to be something of a man despite the environment he was cursed to live in. He taught him how to have hope amidst the suffering. How to find purpose. But that was before everything went to hell. Now, Gray was gone, and Dirk was thrown into another world. In this world, Dirk had a loving family and made friends, albeit few of them. He learned to enjoy himself and cherish others. He was living what could be considered a normal life. And then Azura came. At first, Dirk had been furious. He was being taken against his will, and that man had the audacity to think he could control Dirk. Dirk had rebelled against everything while being taken from his mother. He even smiled as he went through the portal. Even as he was whipped, Dirk had retained his strong mind. He wouldn't be broken. He wouldn't be reduced or controlled. But then he walked into that alleyway. 
he was alone after a many stressful hours. And like a broken dam, horrible memories came flooding back. Dirk was now in a hell like he was on earth. But now, not only was he taken from his family and friends, but he didn't have Grey. He didn't have the man who made hell bearable. He thought back, feeling the pain of his past and remembering his hope. He had hoped that things would be good this time around. He hoped that he finally escaped from trouble. But it came right back to him, swallowing him whole. And now, he couldn't find hope for the future. If there was only pain waiting for him, nothing but suffering and oppression, then what was the point? What was he fighting for? After laying down, Dirk spent hours contemplating. He didn't even stand when he was alerted about the classes he was supposed to be at. But when nobody came around to do anything about it, he didn't think of it again. He seemed to get weaker as he laid there. When another half-day passed, Dirk's hunger and thirst finally started to hurt him enough. He stood and walked out of the alley like a zombie, making his way to the public cafeteria in this dark town. According to Delia, there were two places to eat. The first was the public cafeteria. There, nobody could stop you from eating. Fighting was prohibited in that place. After all, people needed food and water to live. Delaha was serious about not losing their investments. The second place was paid for. Naturally, it was nicer, luxurious. One needed currency to go there though. Dirk went to the free place. Upon entering, he found the line of people and got into it. He didn't even notice the stares he got as he was handed a bowl of slop. It didn't look appetizing in the least. It was something like a soup, maybe oatmeal but with the texture of paste. Dirk had a hard time getting down the first few bites, but it got bearable after a while. With that, he was satiated. He walked out of the cafeteria and back to his alleyway, laying back down with no concern for the world. Only, it didn't seem like people intended to let him be. That first group of three goons wasn't the first in line. After a while, Dirk saw another small group arrive. Like the first, they weren't there to talk. Of course, a fight broke out. Dirk used his skill to break bones and disable his enemies. Only, this second group was stronger than the last, so he got hit a few times. But it was like he didn't feel pain, always recovering from any damage he received. After beating down that group, Dirk brought them all to fingers. The mad doctor was more than happy to receive customers, and Dirk left them in his care. Then, he just went back to the alley. Only, perhaps rumors spread at some point, but more groups continued to show. The first few days it wasn't anything crazy. Maybe two or three groups of three to four people showed, and they were usually easy to handle. They got progressively harder but Dirk had immense innate skill that wouldn't go away even if he was depressed and hopeless. Like that, he delivered more and more people to fingers who began to become more and more fond of Dirk. Every patient seemed to win points with the man. And Dirk only sustained light wounds, if any. Maybe a few burns from fire magic or some bruises from nasty punches. But since Dirk didn't have to go easy on anyone, he could easily take care of his enemies. At least, that was until a week passed. At some point, only one or two people showed, but they were strong. Stronger than Dirk. He didn't know their names and didn't care to ask. They only fought, and he responded in kind, though not enthusiastically. And the result was Dirk's defeat. While his enemies weren't in good shape, he was the first to go down. A broken arm, leg, and ribs. He couldn't even stand and had a hard time breathing. His body dripped blood from multiple wounds caused by dark or earth magic. And when he was done for, his enemies dragged him to fingers just like Dirk did to his enemies. He was literally thrown into the room. Only, Fingers was more angry than happy to have Dirk as a patient. Thankfully, Dirk at least received better treatment. Fingers kept the skin admiring to a minimum while diligently slicing Dirk open to repair his broken bones. Dirk was awake during the surgery, and it was then that he found out that they didn't use numbing agents during any kind of surgery. Dirk had to suffer the pain of being cut open and his bones being reset. No wonder others dreaded being taken here. Compared to the whipping though, 
Dirk found this pain to be rather bearable, though he still let out loud groans of pain. And because his nanites automatically reset bones, fingers didn't have to cut him open that much. It was only the arm that he opened up, and not his leg or ribs. Afterward, Dirk was given healing potions. Within eight hours, he was almost good as new. His own body's healing plus the potions meant no scars remained of either the surgery or injuries. Dirk left the room after Fingers made him promise that he would send more people to him. Like that, Dirk went back to his routine of eating and sleeping in the alleyway. And yet, people still didn't leave him alone. Every other day, there would be more people to fight Dirk. Some groups were bigger while others were stronger. Either way, Dirk was put into a horrible cycle of constantly being harassed or beaten into the floor by people he didn't know. His only rest came to be with fingers while recovering. Dirk quickly broke his vow to never sleep when on his hospital bed. Recover, sleep, eat, go back to the alleyway, get beat up, and get sent to fingers. This became his routine, and it lasted for an entire month. The entire time, Dirk didn't become angry. He wasn't even annoyed. He just took the beatings while dishing out his own. He never seemed to care about anything, and even the people who came to kick him into the dirt noticed. Some people who repeatedly showed up even became reluctant to fight him. Granted, those were only the weak ones who would go to fingers with him at the end of the battle. There was only one time Dirk became serious, and that was when someone tried to steal his shorts, the only pair of clothes he had. That person left with nearly a dozen broken bones and a quarter of his skin seared like meat. Fingers had to treat that person for almost a week, to the mad doctor's great delight, of course. During that month, Dirk was put through dozens of beatings, sometimes multiple in a day. It was like the entire town was targeting him, and Dirk was able to find out through chatter that people were being paid to put him in the hospital. There were strong assassins that led groups of people, and they sent their minions in order to reap some easy rewards. The name Silky was one of these top-ranking assassins, and there were several others. Still, Dirk didn't care. He never even changed his spot. That alley was always the one he went back to. Unfortunately, he couldn't keep up his laziness forever. Come the end of the month, a certain event rolled around. Dirk knew it was coming and had yet to participate in one. The monthly evaluation. It was a test that everyone had to participate in, no exceptions. Those who didn't meet a certain standard would receive physical education. It tested people on what the classes taught them. It was testing their skill as an assassin. At first, Dirk disregarded it. Nobody came to him for his classes, and he didn't want to leave his comfortable alley anyway. But this time, there was a certain someone who was happy to cause him distress that arrived. Wow! To think you've fallen this far. Comparing you to how you were a month ago makes me truly happy. Deliha appeared in the alleyway, looking at Dirk while laughing. When he first came here, he had been barking back like a rabid dog. But now, he was wallowing in filth within an alley. She meant it when she said she was happy at the sight. Dirk didn't respond to her, just remaining laid down on the dirt like he always was. She frowned at this, walking over to him. Hey! Get up, you dog! Bang! Her foot came swinging, slamming into Dirk's back. He grunted as he was sent flying into a wall, almost breaking a hole through it. He coughed as he crawled to his hands and knees. Delaha jumped over and grabbed his hair that had grown out, picking him up. You sorry excuse for shit. I don't care if you can't walk. Nobody is allowed to skip the monthly evaluation. If you don't walk on your own, I'll spike you with my chain and drag you with it. Actually? Why don't I do that anyway? Ack! Dirk suddenly felt a jolt of pain as Della's hand shot out. Her chain spike was buried in his arm, and she yanked it as she walked out of the alleyway. Dirk was pulled forward, the spike in his arm feeling like it was tearing up his nerves. Like that, he was led through the town like a prisoner, coming upon a large tunnel. There were many other people who walked through this tunnel, and many eyes turned to Dirk. Delaha dragged him past all the crowds that made way for her and into an open clearing. Another large cave not much smaller than the town cave. 
this was the place where every assassin in training was evaluated. There were multiple stations for casting magic, testing physical strength, and more. You get to do all the tests, Mr. Harbinger. Let's get this over with so I can whip you. Move. Della spoke before yanking him. Like that, she dumped him into the first test. The first evaluation was magic. Here, Dirk had to show his proficiency in certain spells. Of course, it was the spells that everyone here was taught, and not just whatever he knew. And since Dirk hadn't gone to any classes, he wasn't able to perform a single spell. This naturally resulted in a zero for this particular test. The second evaluation was his martial arts. Here, he was assigned an opponent who he had to fight. The two had to demonstrate their martial art skills. It was here that Dirk shined. He beat several opponents back to back, displaying perfect technique and showing them what they wanted. It was only when he was beat down by a rank 4 opponent that the test stopped. He came out with a mark of 370. Dirk didn't know how good that was. Then came the third test. This was a stealth test. One had to hide from an instructor who went searching for them in what seemed like a maze. There were plenty of obstacles and small structures to use and was a wide enough area that the instructor couldn't immediately sense everyone with magic. Of course, the more proficient one was in the use of stealth magic and techniques, the better and longer they could hide. While Dirk didn't know any stealth magic since he hadn't gone to classes, he was naturally stealthy. He moved silently, evaded everyone, and kept his distance. In the end, the instructor found three people before finding Dirk. Dirk was given a score of 180 before moving on. Finally, the last evaluation was an academic test. Here, Dirk was asked about topics that varied wildly. He was tested on poisons, weapons, chemicals, strategy, hypotheticals, and more. It was here that Dirk actually decided to perform badly. He was silent for many questions. Naturally, he knew the answers to most of them, but not only did he not know what specific answers they wanted from him, but he didn't want to show the knowledge he had. He had a lot of modern knowledge that didn't exist here. He couldn't show anything out of place. Dirk was given a score of 100. With that, the evaluation was over. Dirk was given a final score of 650. Again, he didn't know how good that was. He only knew that Delaho was smiling widely when he came back. He had a foreboding feeling. Dirk waited after finishing, Delaho just standing there and smiling at him. Suddenly, Dirk saw the crowds of people around him part ways. A man came walking through, and Dirk narrowed his eyes at the approaching figure. Azura. He came walking through blindfolded like always, his attention turned to Dirk. The surrounding instructors and adults bowed at the waist when he arrived, including Delia. Azura stopped in front of Dirk, his gaze boring into the half-naked boy who was much shorter than him. Dirk felt deathly pressure from him that made him feel like he was being choked. Delia. Sir. What's his score? Azura asked expectantly. Delia smiled. 650, sir. 650, Harbinger 8, do you know what the highest score one can get is? Dirk was silent. He just stared at Azura, his gaze basically blank like he didn't care. Azura smiled at this. The maximum score is 4000. You failed amazingly at every test. It's like you tried to do horribly. But I know why you didn't score well. You didn't go to a single class during this past month. I heard about all the times you were beaten, your bones broken and wounds mended by fingers. It must have been hellish. But. I assure you. From now on, it will get so much worse. Ack! Azura shot out his hand, grabbing Dirk by the throat and raising him up. Azura spoke softly. Did you think you would be saved? Did you think that if you waited long enough, your mother would come barging in here and pull you out? I want you to remember how weak your mother was in front of me, and know that I never leave here. Even if she showed up, she can do nothing. Even if an army showed up, they would be annihilated as soon as they stepped foot into this place. You will never be saved. 
remember these words well. Who? When Azura dropped Dirk, he breathed in sharply before coughing. He glanced at Dirk before snorting. I gave you your month. You think being beaten every single day was bad? I think it's time I properly introduced you to what hell really feels like. Deliha. Sir. Deliha stepped forward with an expectant face. For every class Harbinger 8 misses, he will receive 50 lashes. The level of the whip will be left to your discretion. Understood. And do be sure to account for all the classes he has already missed. There are four classes a day, and he has missed 30 days. That means 120 lessons have been missed, and 6,000 lashes are needed to make up for them. It is up to you how you go about distributing this physical education over time. Why yes sir. Deliha shivered a bit as excitement came over her. 6,000 lashes. This was basically a permit to whip him whenever and however much she wanted. Of course, Azura saw her excitement, but he didn't mind. That's all I have for you. Go ahead and begin today. Oh, and Harbinger. The lashes will stop when you decide to pledge yourself and give your loyalty. When you decide to bow down and give your everything, then you will no longer be whipped. And... Azura suddenly bent down, pulling Dirk's hair and whispering in his ear. If you pledge yourself, I will allow you to whip Deliha all you want. She'll become your dog to do whatever you want with. Break her mind with pain, make her your sex slave, burn her alive, feed her to the dogs. My reward to you for giving your undying loyalty will be her life. And if you tell her this, the deal is off the table. Think about that as she tears the skin off your back over and over again. With those words, Azura shoved Dirk away. And because Azura isolated the sound while talking, Della heard nothing, still smiling out of anticipation for the fun she would have. With that, Azura left. Deliha was quick to grab Dirk by the throat. Come, little boy. It's time for some physical education. With quick steps, Deliha dragged Dirk all the way to the town square, chaining him to the stone platform. After that, she picked up the level 3 whip. And for the next few hours, screams echoed through the town. Chapter 88, Limbo Slash Classes When the whipping started, Dirk was instantly jolted awake. He hadn't been asleep. But for the entire month prior, he had been in a state of limbo. Not even the fights or the beatings could shake his mind. He just idly went through the days, not having any particular purpose as if he were a wandering zombie. His mind never seemed to think of anything. He was merely existing. But now, his dull eyes sharpened. As soon as that whip streaked down his back, his mind was jostled. He let out a pained roar. He had forgotten how horrifying the pain was. But he was quickly reminded. The whip didn't stop, tearing into him over and over again. Dirk felt the whip's power shoot through him, intentionally causing more pain. It used dark magic, and that dark mana shot through his skin and nerves like thorns, tearing him apart. Deliha laid down forty straight lashes. After that, Dirk was reduced to a groaning mess on the floor, hanging by the shackles on his hands. His back, arms, legs, and even abdomen was nothing but torn skin. Seeing his sorry state, Deliha called someone. It was a dark mage, and he was ordered to heal Dirk. Using magic, Dirk's body was restored within a few minutes. It worked even faster than the potions. Dirk wasn't thankful though. Despite the wounds being gone, it was like he could still feel the pain. Deliha walked over to him. Come on, don't give out just yet. I'm thinking we can do 60 lashes a day. That'll make 100 days of fun. What do you think? I have a dark healer on standby too, so don't worry about not being able to take it. Oh, but you'll still need to go to classes. Unless you want to add to the count, of course. I don't mind. Delia laughed, sending a swift kick at Dirk before walking away. Then, she whipped him twenty more times. Only then was he sent to Fingers to heal. Dirk was numb as Fingers gave him a potion drip. He laid on the stone bed with a blank stare. He couldn't seem to think. With time though, the numbness began to subside. 
he fell into a deep sleep, only to wake up eight hours later. It was time for class. Thinking about how horrible the whipping was, Dirk decided that it was in his absolute best interest to go to class. He dragged himself there, walking through the tunnel and arriving at a large room. There were a few dozen others there with him. All of them were dressed much better than Dirk. Dirk still had bloodstains on him. His shorts were obviously in a poor state having been soaked by blood a few times over. Still, he had nothing to his name, worse than a homeless man. He sat in the class, and by a rude instructor, he was taught about certain magics. There were spells for every element that the instructors wanted them to specifically use, and they had to learn all of them. Dirk was given a list of fire spells, earth spells, and dark spells. At first, Dirk didn't seriously concentrate on learning the spells. The only thing in his mind was the horrible session of physical education. But when he thought about the monthly evaluations, he knew that if he performed badly again, he would likely be put through more. So he decided to scan the spell books and start analyzing them. When he did, he was surprised at what was shown. For the earth spells, there were ones that were surprisingly lethal. For example, disc blades made of rock, rock bullets, and serrated arrows. There were also tactical spells like one called Earthworm that would create snakes of dirt and rock that could wrap and bind people, holding them down. It was like this for every element. There were concentrated fire spells that could focus the volatile element, centering all that power on one person and reducing collateral damage to a minimum. Things like fire needles, fire whips, and more. Finally, the dark element had its plethora of spells. There were curses that could make people weak, blind them, and torture them with pain. There were also special ones like movement techniques that seemed like dialed-down versions of void walking. Dirk even found some specialized spells for the metal element. These spells focused heavily on creating blades that could pierce through any defense, making for clean and efficient kills. It was natural that the spells assassins used were for killing, and Dirk quickly got over his shock seeing the lethality of it all. He picked up on all the runes, and there were only a few spells that had runic pages. Even then, the runic pages weren't complex, meaning Dirk could trace them in a short amount of time. Like that, Dirk was able to brief himself on the magics. The only thing he found though was that whenever he went to perform dark spells, the surrounding mana was resistant to his calling, completely disobeying him. Suddenly, Dirk thought back. When he had faced that dark being, the dark element incarnate, he was told that he would never wield the dark element as long as that being existed. At first Dirk thought that such a thing was preposterous. But when he went to wield the element, he was unable to so much as create a rune. Eventually, Dirk found that only the dark mana within his mana pool was obedient. Of course, it was a small amount of mana, so with just that much he couldn't do a whole lot. Eventually, he had to give up on using more than a few dark spells at a time. With that, Dirk moved on to the next martial arts class. Here, Dirk learned plenty of lethal fighting techniques. Of course, if there was anything Dirk was a master in, it was killing someone with his bare hands. But he found that there was a bit more to it in this world of magic. Dirk only had one anima technique given to him by his anima manual. It was one that allowed him to activate anima throughout his body, using it actively instead of passively. Even at the academy, they didn't teach anything other than martial arts. But here, Dirk found that there was such thing as external anima techniques. These techniques would channel the anima in the body and pass it through anything it touched. For example, one could shoot their anima through their hand and into another person's body. Naturally, because anima is destructive to matter, it obliterates anything it gets channeled into. It was a technique that released pure destructive power. Of course, just releasing this power was easier said than done. There were certain levels to this technique. They called them warrior classes. The classes from weakest to strongest were pawn, knight, rook, bishop, and king. A pawn class warrior could actively activate the anima in their bodies and strengthen it. Dirk would be considered a pawn class warrior. A knight class warrior could move the anima outside their bodies, creating something called aura. This aura could be ejected and used to damage and destroy material. 
it was crude in its utilization, but effective. After that, each successive class refined control over their aura, forming concentrated attacks that could be launched distances and even hardening their aura into something tangible. Dirk was surprised by this information. He thought Ainma was an energy that was only supposed to reside within the body, strengthening its base attributes. It turns out that there was a lot the Academy didn't teach. Which brought Dirk to a question. Why didn't the Academy teach these things? They certainly had the knowledge if an assassin organization had it. Suddenly, Dirk thought back to what Geralt once told him. He spoke of the Empire taking advantage of the Academy students, only teaching them certain things when they pledged to join the military. Now Dirk was understanding what he was talking about. The Empire only gave this in-depth knowledge to the people who would work for it. It made sense, so Dirk didn't blame them. Still, he wished that he had at least known what he was missing out on. With all this knowledge introduced to him, Dirk realized that the martial arts classes here would be very beneficial to him. Learning actual fighting techniques was redundant since he was already a master, but training his ability to utilize anima and create aura would be extremely valuable. It would increase his lethality many times over. After the martial arts class, Dirk moved on to two others. The third class was one that taught about Assassin Protocol, or Assassin 101. It taught techniques and skills related to sneaking and planning. Most of it was academic knowledge that drilled into people how to go about their future jobs. What were the steps to take when attempting to steal something from a high-security estate? What preparations did you need to make when attempting to assassinate a similarly strong enemy? Dirk also knew a lot about this stuff. After all, he had personally executed plenty of such operations. In fact, there wasn't much that these people could teach him in the way of any basics. The only stuff he didn't know about was magic-related. For example, there were magic alarms, material enchantments, and magic traps that one had to watch out for. And these weren't simply deactivated with the snip of a wire. Depending on one's tier, some magic traps or alarms were impossible to deactivate without tripping. And when Dirk was taught all about these traps and alarms, he was surprised by their complexity. They used both powerful hardware in the form of enchanted material and intricate software in the form of base enchantments. There were many runes to learn and many different elemental enchantments to study. After all, one could face any kind of elemental obstacle. You had to be prepared for everything. Finally, after that third class came the fourth class. This class taught about various preparatory items. There were many poisons and potions to learn about, as well as auxiliary gadgets with surprising mechanical complexity. Dirk was impressed when he saw wrist arrow launchers and magical smoke bombs. If the third class talked about all the protocol, steps, and preparation, this class gave the know-how on those steps and specific preparations. It was thorough, and there was a lot for Dirk to learn even with all the knowledge he had. Those four classes took two to three hours each, making it a ten to twelve hour learning day. There wasn't much rest in between, but these people didn't care. They only wanted results when the month came around. Dirk went through all the classes, his mind being distracted from the horrible situation he was actually in. When they were over, Dirk walked to the cafeteria and got some food, filling himself with nutrients. Upon walking out of the cafeteria though, Dirk froze. A woman was standing outside, her arms crossed and a large smile on her face. She eyed Dirk as if he were a toy. Day 2 of 100. Ready for another round of physical education? Della sneered at him, and Dirk suddenly felt his skin sting. He didn't move, only staring at Della with unwillingness. She smiled even more. Follow. She spoke and turned, walking toward the town square. Dirk didn't move though. When she turned back around after a few steps, she huffed and shot out her hand. Pack. Pack. Dirk let out a grunt as her chain spike pierced through his arm. After that, he was yanked forward, dragged along. Then, he was chained to that same cold metal pole. The ground that had previously been soaked by his blood was dry, but it wouldn't be for long. His heart rate increased as Della grabbed the whip. He really didn't want to feel that pain again. But he could do nothing. 
After she sinisterly smiled, screams ensued, the surrounding onlookers staring at his suffering with fear. Dirk's routine turned into two things. Learning and whipping. He would wake up, go to classes for the day, eat, and then get dragged off by Della to get whipped. After he was reduced to a bloody mess, he'd be sent to fingers and get healed. Nothing ever remained of the wounds. His skin always healed over, becoming perfectly smooth as always. His muscles also healed. Any broken bones were mended by his nanites and healed by the potions. And although he lost tons of blood each time, Dirk was never in an anemic state. Due to the enhancement he was forced into by Geral and that experimental potion, Dirk's blood regeneration was high. He could regenerate it all while passed out in Finger's medical room, especially thanks to the potions. Truly, the potions were high quality and expensive. But Dirk wasn't appreciative. It only made his suffering worse. There were no days off, and he had to bear the whipping each and every time. Two weeks passed like that. Sometimes Delaho would come around before he went to class, making the classes harder to focus in since he would just barely be healed enough to remain conscious. The only solace for Dirk was that the pain of the level 3 whip became bearable after a while. Only, even that was taken away when Delaha noticed his tolerance rising. She was quick and happy to increase to level 4, showing him a new world of pain. Dirk was increasingly beaten down. The days became harder to continue through, and Dirk constantly felt weak. Even when he was perfectly healed, his mind was occupied by the pain that he knew was waiting for him. His back, his limbs, and any part of him that was torn apart by that whip hurt whenever he thought about it. It was the phantom pain. It never seemed to go away. Perhaps deep down though, Dirk knew it was his mental state. Every since he stepped into that alleyway, it was like all his confidence and willpower came tumbling down. He knew it was stupid of him to allow himself to become so pitiful. He knew that it went against everything he stood for. But when he thought about how unfair his situation was, he couldn't help it. He was supposed to be the son of a noble, someone who enjoyed luxury and privilege. The only things Dirk should have to worry about are school and magic. For a while, the only things he did were forging and studying. Along with dungeon diving and being with Ava, that had been enough. Dirk was content. He was finally experiencing a life of productivity and happiness. So of all the situations Dirk had to be thrown into, why did it have to be this? Why did his mother have to be a former assassin? Why did it have to be him who was taken? Why did he have to get dragged into this torturous hell? He already lived the life of a cold killing machine, one who was nothing more than a dog to do someone else's dirty work. So why? Why did this have to happen again? Dirk shook his head whenever he thought of blaming his mother, but he couldn't help think about it anyway. And the daily whippings didn't help. At first, Dirk never considered Azura's offer. But after a while, Della's smile became so hateful and irritating. He hated her laughs. He hated being stabbed and dragged by her chain spike. He hated her pretentious degradations. Whenever his mind wasn't being overwhelmed by pain, he was thinking about how much he wished to kill her. But the thought of pledging himself to Azura was worse. He had said that he wouldn't be broken, and that meant that he wouldn't accept the offer no matter how tempting it was. Still, the urge got worse every day. His heart was constantly filled with hate. When Deliha appeared in front of him after classes, the only thing he could imagine was putting a bullet through her skull. This continued for another two weeks. At this time though, instead of being taken for a whipping, Dirk was taken to the monthly testing area. Like that, he took the four tests once more. And this time, his score was much higher. 1300, it wasn't fantastic, but double what he had before. And what mattered was that he was going to classes. Delia didn't care though. After he was done, she took Dirk to the town square like always. And as a reward for doing so well, she gave him an extra twenty lashings. It was at this point that the hate in Dirk's heart deepened. Across the course of another month, Dirk kept thinking about how much he hated getting whipped every day. He hated Delia, but above all, he hated Azura for bringing him here. The third month after Dirk's arrival came around, 
marking yet another test. On this, Dirk got 1570. It wasn't much better, and because of the small improvement, Delaha went even harder with her lashings. Then, the fourth month. Another test, and another set of lashings. After this fourth month though, Dirk was finally feeling a little hope. Ninety days had passed, and Dirk only had ten more days of lashings. Day 100 out of 100. Who would have thought you'd actually survive all of this? Delaha smiled a bit as Dirk was chained up as usual. Thinking, she went to the level 6 whip. Over the course of three months, Dirk's tolerance had risen even more. They had moved up to level 5 already, but only used it for a couple weeks. Since it's your last day, and technically I've gone beyond 6,000 lashings, I'll change things up. 30 lashings with the level 6 whip. Dirk was silent. Right now, he didn't care about anything else. He just wanted to get this day over with. After today, he wouldn't have to suffer through this again. Then, it started. Crack. Ah. Dirk let out a scream. No matter how many times he had gone through this, when Delaha used a higher level whip, it was as if he had no pain tolerance. The metal cattails on the whip shot dark mana through his body, searing his nerves directly. When the twentieth whip came around, Dirk collapsed. A dark healer merely repaired his body though before they continued. And when they were done, Dirk was a mess on the floor. Deliha let out a soft breath. Ha! That was nice. Well, it's sorry that this is our last day together. I rather enjoyed it. Get him out of here. Delilah waved and walked off. A couple guards grabbed Dirk afterward, taking him to Fingers as they had dozens of times already. Even Fingers was already expecting Dirk. As soon as Dirk was laid down, a needle went into his body, infusing a potion. That level 6 whip had not only torn his skin, but ripped his muscles and broken several bones. It was all healed though with the potions. As Dirk's body was repaired at a visible speed, he slightly smiled and closed his eyes. It's finally over. Like that, he passed out. For the first time in a long time, he actually looked forward to tomorrow. Chapter 89, Laid Bear Upon waking from his deep sleep, Dirk immediately headed to his class that was starting soon after. By now, walking right out of the medical room into his classes had become normal. Dirk would take all the time he could to sleep and recover, and classes took up half the day, so there wasn't a lot of room for free time. Now though, Dirk had a small smile. He sat down in class with a bit more energy than before, and he absorbed what was taught with a bit more enthusiasm. While the teachers were still rude and would be critical over every error, Dirk didn't mind. And then, when the classes were done, Dirk anxiously made his way to the cafeteria. He stepped in line, got his food, and savored the near-tasteless bowl of slop. It tasted better today. Dirk was a bit happy, though he didn't show it on his face. But then, the time came to step out. Dirk walked out of the cafeteria with slow steps. His eyes scanned the surroundings. The only thing he saw was the curious gazes of those around him. By now, Dirk had become almost famous since he had been whipped every single day for over three months. There was nobody who didn't know his name and didn't know Della who was always waiting for another session of physical education. But this time, when Dirk walked out of the cafeteria, there was no Della waiting for him. He stood around for a minute, almost unsure if it was okay for him to walk away. Then, after a few more seconds, he walked off. He was in a bit of a daze as he walked back to his alleyway. The dirt all around the alley was dyed with blood from all the fights Dirk had here but it had become something of a home, as sad as that was. When Dirk sat down on a patch of dirt, he couldn't help the small smile that came to his face. It's over. He let out a small chuckle. He wasn't dragged off to receive sixty lashes. Dirk had diligently gone to his classes, no matter how tired or hurt he was, in order to prevent more lashes from being added to the massive pile he had to endure. Now, that work had paid off. Now I can relax a bit. He sighed as he lay down. With a content face, he fell asleep. 
he was naturally a bit tired since fatigue had built up over such a long period of being exhausted every day. Now, he could go to sleep in a normal fashion, not while recovering on a stone bed. The next morning, Dirk was up bright and early. Well, there was no sunlight in this place, so it wasn't bright, but it was early. After enjoying some quiet time, Dirk ate at the cafeteria before heading to classes with high energy levels. Now, he was actually a bit eager to learn. After all, they were giving out valuable knowledge despite being an assassin organization. Dirk was more inclined to absorb it when he wasn't beaten down from lashings. The classes took most of his day, and afterward, he ate before walking out of the cafeteria. Like last time, he was a bit anxious as he left, but when he saw no Delia again, he was happy. For him, that was a confirmation of the fact that he wouldn't suffer as he did for the past few months. Finally, he was relieved. Thus, he went about the rest of his day quietly. He sat in his alleyway and actually brought up his traced runes, doing a bit of studying. He did this until late at night, after which he went soundly to sleep once more. Then, the next morning came. Dirk went about this day as normal, eating before heading to classes. When classes were over, he took his time in the cafeteria. The slop he had been eating every day wasn't nice, but as he found out, it was actually packed with nutrients. At the very least, it would keep him alive and his energy high. Then, Dirk strolled out of the building. He had a small smile. When he walked out, he couldn't help but think about how great it was not worrying about being whipped every single day. Dirk immediately turned in the direction of his alleyway, intending to go back before doing some more runic study. Harbinger 8 At that moment, there was a shout from behind. Dirk immediately froze, hesitant to turn around, fearful of who he might see. During that hesitation, the one who shouted seemed to teleport behind him. Her hand grabbed his shoulder, and her sharp nails cut into his skin. Did you miss me? Della spoke into his ear, like the whisper of a devil. Dirk trembled a bit, not immediately responding. Della smiled. Say, I recently got bored. Our sessions of physical education had been an enjoyable pastime, a way to relieve the stress of my day. I will admit, the whipping also got repetitive, but now that I've had a couple days off, I realized how much I enjoyed it. So I went to Azura. I thought that perhaps it was a bit unfair to just drag you off and whip you for no reason. Della spoke as she circled him. Her finger traced from one shoulder to another, leaving a red line of blood across his back. Dirk entirely disregarded it. This amount of pain was pitiful compared to the whipping. It almost didn't register as pain. She stopped as she spoke into his other ear. Guess what Azura told me? He said that you still hadn't pledged yourself to him. He said that he had offered you a deal that you hadn't yet accepted. So he gave me an order. He said that until you accept his deal and give your loyalty, I'm free to hand out fifty lashes a day. And no. Ha ha. Yes. Isn't that exciting? Really, I didn't appreciate the time we spent together before. But now, I'm going to savor every moment. With her cackle, Della stabbed Dirk's arm with her chain spike. His body was pulled forward as she suddenly ran toward the town square. Dirk's mind was almost blank as he was chained up. The men who chained him were fluid with their actions. It had become reflex for them who had done this every day for the past three months. Then, Della grabbed the level six whip. You've had a couple days of rest, so why don't we continue where we left off? And by the way, the level six whip and beyond have magic that I can activate. That pain you felt before was only the barest capacity of this thing. If you survive long enough, maybe we can try it out. Della laughed as she raised her hand. The whip cracked as she got the feel for it. Then, she swung towards Dirk. Before the whip reached him though, something had changed in Dirk's mind. It was like something broke inside of him. It wasn't he who had finally been broken. Instead, as the whip came down and tore away the skin on his back, it was like a layer of himself was being peeled back. With the wave of pain, Dirk's mind seemed to experience a moment of unprecedented clarity. 
For the first time, he was faced with his innermost emotions that had been sealed up and shoved down below his veil of depression and despair. He could no longer hide from it. The rage and hatred he felt, the bubbling chaos that had been brewing inside of him. It exploded. Ah! Dirk's eyes were bloodshot as he let out a guttural roar. This roar, backed by all the power in his trembling body, seemed to shake the entire town. It wasn't a roar of pain. Even Delaho realized what was happening. His mind has finally been cornered. Suddenly, Azura appeared in a corner of the town square, his gaze directed at Dirk who continued to roar despite the lashings. It was as if he didn't feel the pain as he drowned everything out with his hate. He had gone completely mad. Azura knew. This was what he had been waiting for. Della had tortured Dirk every single day for one hundred days. Dirk was mutilated every single time, put through unbearable hell. Azura had never actually had so much trouble with any other child before. He was shocked that Dirk had withheld himself and didn't completely break down. But he had been patient. It was a process, breaking someone. So he gave Delaha her orders, and Dirk was beat down bit by bit. Then, when the one hundred days was over, he was given a moment of rest. For two days, Azura held Delia back. Dirk had been anxious, but relieved when he thought it was all over. He thought that there wouldn't be any more suffering. He even confirmed it when the second day came around and nothing happened. But then, when the third day dawned, she went. Then, he watched. He watched as Dirk's glimmer of hope was destroyed. He watched as all the relief was burned away. As soon as Dirk began to climb out of the abyss, as soon as he saw that tiny ray of light, he was yanked back down. That was the last straw. Dirk had barely held out through the three months. He had been holding on to that hope deep down inside that the pain would eventually end. That through following directions, he could slip by and dodge the inevitable future before him. And now that he knew he couldn't, now that his hope was shattered, he snapped. When Azura heard Dirk's roar, he knew that a critical moment had presented itself. Dirk was now faced with his most carnal form out of sheer desperation, and he had to make a decision. Dirk's inner turmoil was so immense that it caused him even physical pain. The pain of his mind was so great that it seemed to tear him apart alongside the whip. His roars died down as more lashings tore at his body. He began to weaken. As he fell to his knees, unable to hold himself up, Azura spoke a message through magic to Delia. Heeding her master's command, she dropped the level of the whip and continued. Over time, as Dirk struggled and collapsed in on himself, Delia eased up. She didn't make him pass out from the pain. She let him think, as per her master's orders. And Dirk really did think. He couldn't seem to escape the darkness that crawled through his soul and broke him from within. It will never end. Dirk heard a whisper as he hugged his head. They will whip you. They will break you. You will be nothing more than a dog. Shut up. Dirk screamed at the voices that appeared in his head. I won't be broken. I can't be broken. They have already broken you. No. I just. It will never end. You will always suffer. I. I don't want to suffer. It hurts. Dirk remembered the pain of the whip, how it tore into him until even his bones were exposed. He didn't want to feel that every day. The pain will find you. It will always be there to bring you to your knees. Feel the whip. Feel the blades tear you apart. Look to the future, and gaze upon the endless torture that awaits you. Despair. Dirk's mind was shaken by that voice of chaos. He curled in on himself, and even though the whip got weaker, he still felt that tearing pain, as if his pain tolerance had vanished. Despair. As if that voice were speaking through him, Dirk mumbled that word. The cracks of the whip echoed in his ears, bringing along with it searing pain. On earth, he suffered even as a child. Forced to kill for people who thought nothing of him, he was forged into a cold killer. In this new world, he enjoyed his thirteen years of life before being dragged down into this hell. Dirk, who had a taste of what love and fulfillment were like, had been crushed when it was taken away. 
he desperately wanted what was taken from him. Suffering. It seemed to follow him across lives. He was dragged into the worst of it, especially here. It seemed like he never had the power to control his own life. On earth, he had been so brainwashed into thinking that what he did was all he could do, and he was bound by chains of his own making. Here, it was actual power that kept him from holding on to what he desired, chains that he struggled against yet couldn't break free from. He never had control. And when he didn't have control, he suffered. Could he ever gain control? Would he ever have that power? These were the questions that rang out in his mind. And for a while, even as the whip cracked, even as that voice of chaos spoke to him, he faced his inner turmoil. If the suffering would never end, then what was the point in fighting? Should he just lay down? But if he gave himself up to Azura, then would the suffering stop? It wouldn't. Like on earth, he would do the bidding of another man until he was no longer needed. His life would no longer be his. And by the time he wanted out, it would be too late. But he couldn't escape Azura. There was no way out of this hell. So what was the other alternative? All this suffering, what was it for? What's the point of continuing on? At that moment, Dirk remembered the one person who got him through hell before. As if he had come to him from beyond the world of the living. Damn it. If you're going to suffer every day, then you may as well do it better than everyone else. That rough voice echoed in his ears. What do I always tell you? Suffer now so you can suffer better tomorrow. Now get your sorry ass up and keep running. The memories flashed through his mind. Life is pain. You think you can avoid it? Only pussies try to avoid it, and they're the ones who take a bullet to the dick and die miserably on the battlefield. The only light in the darkness. Look, if you're going to go through all this pain, you may as well get something out of it. If you keep thinking that this is for nothing, then you'll get nothing out of it. Or, you can just get fucking better. So get that head of yours screwed on right and stack some fucking bodies. Take it as one last order from your damn superior. Have I earned enough of your respect for you to obey me this once? Ha. Dirk let out a hollow breath. It was like he could see that lumberjack yelling at him with a cigar in his mouth. Did he reach out from the afterlife just to yell at him again? At some point, tears began to drip down his chin, landing and mixing into the pool of blood below him. An indiscernible smile appeared on his face. Yes, sir. Dirk choked out those words. Della tilted her head at the language she couldn't understand. He hadn't spoken in this world's native language. Then, Dirk shifted his body, climbing to his hands and knees from the floor. His body was completely drenched in red, lacerations lining every part of his back and exposing even his ribcage. Deliha was about to lay down another whip, but Azura stopped her. He appeared in front of Dirk whose blood had dyed the stone platform a hundred times before. He saw the tears in Dirk's eyes, and Azura felt himself smile. At the same time, Dirk could sense another being near him. Black tendrils surrounded his soul, not striking, just waiting patiently. I will save you. The road itself into his mind. It was just as grating as always. I will give you the power to live a life without pain and suffering. You will become undefeatable, a vessel that even your enemies could never touch. You will have everything you ever wanted. Give yourself to the darkness. Become one with abyssal chaos. Dirk's soul was shaken. Through his soul, he could see that dark being, the dark element incarnate. Its void black eyes bore into him, carrying with it sincerity and greed. Then, Azura spoke. This can all stop. Give yourself to me. I will give you strength, and you will become my harbinger of chaos. They both extended their hands to him, promising him a sweet future full of power. They would get rid of the pain. And the price was his being. Give himself up, and be guided by another. He would no longer have to worry about his next steps. His path would be carved for him, and all he had to do was obey orders, to just do what he was best at. It was easy. He wouldn't have to think. He wouldn't have to struggle so much. He could just go with the flow. But I already did that once. 
Dirk chuckled. He had already lived a short life of obedience. And that life ended when he finally raised his head and fought back. He had died, perhaps even given his life for freedom. The freedom to explore things he'd never had. Things he believed he deserved. The love, the passion, the happiness of this life. What would be the point then if he just bowed back down? Those abyssal tendrils crept closer, wrapping around the limbs of his soul. Azura also extended his hand, raising Dirk's body. Azura's eyes were expectant. He saw Dirk struggle and knew that there was nowhere for him to go but toward him. He would give in. Azura had been waiting a while for this moment. The dark element incarnate also shivered in excitement. Dirk's pure soul was ripe for the taking. He just had to give in, just a little bit, and that chaotic being would have the ultimate vessel. But then, Dirk's raised his head. He faced Azura with tear streaks down his face, and his soul began to light up the dark tendrils around it. Azura looked into those eyes of Dirk's. Through them, he saw. Antagony. He saw defiance, an unyielding will that had now been forged through the fire of his hell. When the black tendrils around Dirk's soul were burned and consumed, that dark being also knew the choice Dirk made. In this critical moment when all had been laid bare, Dirk chose resistance. He raised his head, and he devoted his life to the hope and light of what existed beyond the darkness. Roar! The dark being cried out as it was burned away. The tendrils all retracted, and Dirk gained control over another large amount of dark mana. That dark being left with one final attack, shaking and weakening Dirk's soul with a slap of dark mana. You will regret this decision. You will regret ever choosing the fight. It bellowed as it pulled back. At the same time, Azura clenched his teeth. Dirk smiled at him while blood dripped from his nose. Pooh! Then, he spat in Azura's face. With his spit came blood. Of course, none of it hit Azura who used magic, but that didn't matter. Damn you! Bang! With a furious roar, Azura tightened his grip on Dirk and sent out a fist. Dirk's ribs were shattered as it dug into his side. Still, he looked into Azura's gaze with a derisive gaze, as if looking down on him, telling him how pathetic he was. Don't look at me with those eyes. I will break you. I will give you hell for the rest of your damned life. You learn under me, and you fight for me. I will have your subordination. I will have your life. Give yourself to me. Go cough. Fuck yourself. Dirk sneered at Azura's rage while blood poured from his mouth. The two gazed into each other. Dirk felt like he could see Azura's enraged eyes from under that cloth. And Azura could see Dirk's defiance through his sharp eyes. Behind that rage though, Azura couldn't help the shock. How could a child have such a strong will? He was unwilling to believe that Dirk couldn't be broken. He began to think that this critical moment wasn't actually the turning point he thought it was. But he also wasn't naive. At this moment, Dirk's will was firm. It would take more pain and time. Stepping up to the platform, Azura snatched a whip and began doing things himself. His rage was taken out with each loud crack and gouging of flesh, as if only blood could satiate his hunger for submission. Under those powerful swings, Dirk quickly passed out, and it was only then that Azura stopped out of fear of killing him. He let out a few rough breaths before dropping the whip, thinking for a moment before turning to Delia. Every day. Fifty lashes. I don't care if it takes ten years. He will fall. Understood. Delia was meek under Azura's rage. When he walked away, Dirk was dragged away to heal. He will fall. Azura mumbled as he disappeared. Chapter 90, Emerge After that day, Dirk no longer fought against the suffering. He no longer avoided it. He accepted it as a fact of his life. But he did fight. He fought against the people and things that brought him suffering. Through that adversity, he would become better. He would reach higher and higher until the problems of today couldn't hurt him. Suffer now so you can suffer better later. Gray told him that, and Dirk began to truly understand that statement. 
he had to fight now, fight against the pain, so that he could bear it and stride down the road. For a while, Dirk had thought that he could avoid the pain, and that would make things easier. But now he realized that since it would always be there, since it would never go away, he was the one who had to become stronger. Granted, this new mentality didn't make the process much easier. Crack. Ack. Every day, Dirk was dragged off by Delia, chained up, and given another slice of hell. Due to him causing Azura displeasure, Delia was out for his blood and screams. It was her job to break him, and she began taking that job seriously. Crack. Ah. Dirk's voice became background noise to the people of the town, his screams like the calls of a bird that everyone came to ignore. Nobody even stopped to watch him get whipped anymore, even though it was a rule. It just happened that often. Crack. Ugh. But that didn't mean people didn't notice the changes when they came. At some point, the screams became quieter. The roars died down, and the cracks of the whip were unaccompanied by that familiar exclamation. People were confused when they heard the whip cracking and no scream afterward. It was almost like someone was swinging a whip around for fun. Crack! And when they went to go face that incongruity, they gazed upon the red stone platform, and they saw a man standing tall. Crack! Dirk's face grimaced when the whip tore into him, but he remained standing and silent. When Deliha got pissed off, she would launch the whip out at his legs and knock him to the floor. But he would always pull himself back up. Crack! It had been six months since Dirk hardened himself, and ten months since he had entered this hell. Ever since he made his decision, he had been whipped almost every day. It was only ever so occasionally that Delia didn't show up, giving him a rare moment of rest. In the past six months, it had happened only three times. In those six months, the only thing Dirk did other than go to class and eat was take the monthly tests. As for the fighting competitions that happened every three months, Dirk didn't fight in those. Instead, he was whipped in front of the entire town, perhaps as a show of humiliation. Dirk had passed his months like that. Wake up from recovery, go to class, eat, and get whipped. It was routine, but Dirk wasn't just idly going through this cyclical schedule. The first thing Dirk had done was change up his situation a bit. How pathetic was it to return to a patch of dirt in an alleyway? There was also the only pair of shorts on him that had been soaked by blood several times over. Dirk decided to change that. So he found someone, or more like a group of people. There were many that had attacked Dirk his first month here. His AI remembered those faces. And now, he was coming back to return the favor. After a few short fights and a couple deliveries to fingers, Dirk had himself a new pair of shorts. He also got himself a small room inside an apartment building. Whenever he wasn't recovering, he was in here. Inside the room was nothing more than a crappy mattress, a chair, and a wooden bin. And in Dirk's eyes, the wooden bin was the most valuable item. With that, Dirk called upon a magic that he learned long ago. Chore magic, magic that was so simple, even if you didn't have the attributes, you could perform it. After a bit of concentration, Dirk was able to conjure a blob of water. Like that, he repeatedly cast this tiny magic to create dozens of blobs of water, filling the tub. And he took a bath. He got rid of all the dirt and dried blood on him. He cleaned himself and his clothes up. When he was out, he looked relatively fresh. His shorts weren't soaked in blood anymore, and he didn't feel like a dirty pig. From then on, Dirk would clean himself up after all the whippings. After recovering, of course. That was another thing he got himself to do. Dirk no longer spent eight to ten hours in Finger's room. After recovering enough, he would leave for the apartment. It usually took five hours to recover, and Dirk would be fatigued when he left early, but with this he had some free time. And with that free time, Dirk's mind focused on the future. His advances in power, his plans of action, how he would fight. Over those six months, Dirk forced himself to fight in some way. When Delia came to grab him, he actually started to fight her. It would result in an extra beating, but how could he care about such little pain? 
he did it to make the process of getting him to that platform all the more difficult. He no longer just followed them. Even when the guards were chaining him down, he was fighting them, throwing out surprise kicks and jabs. Other than that, he began to fight his own secret battle. Dirk turned to his traced runes, and he studied his ass off. He accumulated his mana heart of fire and lightning, making it stronger. He also resumed his blood destruction. He wanted to finish it. And he made no excuses. Even with the beatings, Dirk was destroying nearly 30% of his blood supply every two weeks. It made him much weaker, and his days became that much more difficult to trudge through. But he did it anyway. He was like a machine that would run even on dry fuel. But his body had adapted. His AI had learned how to seal off the blood vessels in his back and limbs, preventing tons of blood from spilling during the whipping. That helped Dirk recover faster. And along with his blood destruction, he was able to increase his strength. And that wasn't all. Although Dirk knew that the chances were slim, he started working towards something. He began formulating a way to escape. Dirk refused to believe that there was no way out of this place. This wasn't a prison, but a training ground. People had to come in and out, and Dirk highly doubted that Azura conjured a portal every time someone needed to enter or leave. So there had to be an exit, and Dirk was going to find it. Not only that, he was going to either sneak or fight his way out. So he began making preparations to do so. He planned his routes, and his AI got a read on every guard and their patrol routes. He began following these guards and staff members, seeing where they left to when the day was done. He also prepared some small weapons. He used metal magic to conjure some blades that he stashed away and a few other small tools. He learned everything he could. But learning guard routes wasn't enough. He needed distractions, diversions. He needed chaos to cover his path. So for this, he turned to alchemy. It wasn't really alchemy, not like what Ava did. Dirk had long started to learn about poisons and tools that assassins used. And surprisingly, one of the tools was bombs. The bombs weren't powerful since they were only made with black powder, so it was used in the form of smoke bombs and such. But Dirk had his modern knowledge. He knew how to synthesize bombs, and this place has all sorts of chemicals in stock. So Dirk started snatching some. A dash of sulfuric and nitric acid, plus a bit of sweet glycerin, and Dirk was able to gradually synthesize a sizable amount of his own nitroglycerin. He carried out the synthesis in his apartment room over a fairly long period, and the process almost resulted in a massive explosion, but he was careful enough and succeeded in making a small supply. He then created bomb capsules and detonators. And during this time, he simultaneously planned their positioning. Thankfully, this entire town was in a cave. It wouldn't take much to collapse certain parts of it, and Dirk could shake off pursuers rather easily with a well-timed detonation. Thus, he formed his plans, everything taking shape in his head. But that wasn't all. In this world of magic, simple stealth techniques weren't enough. People could detect you through aura alone. So Dirk needed to learn magical stealth. And that was why he put most of his study time into comprehending the runes behind the book Theory of Stealth. Truly, once Dirk began comprehending those runes, he realized how profound it was. It covered all aspects of what stealth was. From your effects on the surrounding mana to the sounds your feet made against different materials. It even talked about aura and how it was released from the soul. When you sensed someone's aura, you were sensing the state of their soul. Apparently souls had something like fields of power around them. Aura was these fields, and it could be strengthened by both someone's rank and tier. So the book talked about retracting aura, pulling back that soul field. It was extraordinarily complex, so much so that the same information was written down in all the elements. Dirk worked on comprehending this single section for all his elements. This was actually the advice of the book. It spoke of the association between attributes and the soul, and that learning stealth and all the elemental runes would help one learn it better. Though, when it spoke on the nature of the soul, things got vague. Dirk guessed that was some high-level information not contained within low-level runic pages. 
Still, for the current Dirk, it was his most valuable information. He studied and studied, comprehending all kinds of information about the concepts behind stealth as a whole. And he worked on the things he read. The book was almost all theory, not applied spell formations. So other than basic spells for masking the sounds of his feet and body and techniques on how to move through the atmosphere silently, Dirk had to learn how to apply this theory by himself. Especially when it came to aura retraction. There weren't any spell formations, only runic outlines. Luckily, Dirk had time. He was patient as he focused on expanding his arsenal, working on both his own abilities and plans. He observed the guards over long periods of time, and he created a totally complete map in his head. Through this, he was able to find two locations that might be the exit. So before Dirk went all in, he did some infiltration. He picked one of the places, and he moved into it. It was a tunnel that led to other tunnels after passing through a staff area. Dirk went as deep as he could while observing everything around him. And then, he made it to the end. It was a large room, one that looked similar to an office. There were bookshelves and a window that looked down at the entire town. Only, Dirk froze when he entered. At the back of this room was a desk, and a blindfolded man sat behind it. Have you come to pledge your loyalty? Azura sneered when he saw Dirk in the doorway. Dirk also panicked, but not for long. As if he resigned to his fate, he began looking around to map the place out. When he took his eyes off Azura though, the man appeared next to him. Azura grabbed Dirk's chest, his fingers piercing through muscle and grabbing his ribcage, and slammed him to the floor. Boom! Dirk's body was shaken by the impact, and blood poured from his mouth as Azura leaned over him. What do you think you're doing, Harbinger? Trying to escape? Sorry to disappoint, but there is no exit to this place. Nice try though. Hack! Dirk choked as Azura grabbed his neck. Then, he dragged Dirk all the way back to the town. Deliha. Sir. At Azura's call, Deliha quickly appeared. She saw Dirk who was being choked and smiled a bit. This little bug was wondering where he shouldn't. He will need 100 lashes as an apology. You will also need to increase the guards on rotation. There isn't an exit, but we can't have people going where they aren't supposed to. Understood. Deliha nodded before grabbing a whip. It was the level 8 whip, and she quickly went to work. Then, Dirk grit his teeth through the 100 lashes. Halfway through, he came close to death since he also had internal injuries, but it wasn't anything a dark healer couldn't fix on the spot. With that quick recovery, Dirk was forced through the rest. By now, Deliha had already begun to activate the magic behind the whips. There was fire magic, ice magic, and metal magic within the whips that gave various effects. Sometimes, Dirk's skin would be incinerated, or frozen, or slashed by hundreds of tiny blades. Deliha used it however she liked. Still, Dirk's tolerance had risen to level 8. Even Deliha was shocked by it. But level 8 still put him on the floor, so she stuck with it. Like that, Dirk was sent to fingers after having passed out. Five hours later, he woke up with a groggy head. By now, Fingers never messed with Dirk since he was such a frequent patient. There was the possibility that Dirk would attack him during any one of his hundreds of visits if he tried something. Dirk left after waking. The first hour after becoming conscious was always the hardest as he felt all the stinging and soreness of his body, as well as the immense fatigue. But by now, after a bunch of blood destruction, his recovery ability was top-notch. The only thing he was disappointed by was the fact that his blood destruction took so long to complete. Perhaps it was because of all the time he spent without doing any cycles, as well as all the blood he lost, but he definitely lost progress. After six months though, he had regained ground, and felt almost finished. Arriving at his apartment room, Dirk sat down on the torn mattress. Sighing, he looked inward. There was one other thing Dirk had come to find after making his decision six months ago. In fact, it came only a day afterward. Dirk had felt his soul take on form. Back before he had been taken, Dirk already discovered the phenomenon of something inside his soul taking shape. 
Now, that was much more pronounced. Over the last six months, Dirk had felt as if his soul was actively building something inside of it. It wanted to become something more. This was the stigma that Cecilia had told him about. Dirk could instinctively feel it. It wasn't far from forming. He was a bit excited by it. So with anticipation, Dirk continued scouting, disregarding Azura's words of hopeless endeavors. He still went to classes and learned everything he could. Over six months, he had learned a lot of lethal spells and even his martial arts had sharpened up. He began to get close to forming aura with his anima, which ironically was called the same thing as soul's aura. Though, Dirk had too much of a hard time with moving anima out of his body, so any results wouldn't come soon. Like that, he waited a while before doing some more searching. Since Dirk was able to eliminate one path, he decided to scout the other. Only, upon arrival, he saw that there were now guards stationed at the tunnel. After thinking, Dirk just shot straight toward them. He didn't attack, instead dodging their attacks and bouncing off, shooting past them. He ran through the tunnel, his only goal to map out this unknown area. Those guards were hot on his tail as he used his full strength to avoid them. Then, Dirk made it to the end. And he saw nothing. What? It was a dead end. He had run down this tunnel that was nearly 100 meters long. And at the end, there was nothing but a wall of dirt. The tunnel just stopped. The guards snickered at him who was now cornered. What, you thought the exit was here? Congrats, you found the tunnel that was leading to a new construction site. The guards just watched as Dirk frowned. He faced the dirt wall as his thoughts spun. This can't be it. Unless there's a secret door in a room somewhere, this is the only place an exit can be. He was silent, his gut suspicious of the situation as the guards laughed at him. Then, they walked toward him. Come on. The bloody mistress is going to have fun with another escape at Dash. Rumble. A small tremor interrupted the guard. He suddenly saw Dirk use magic to separate the wall in front of him. He was digging through, exceptionally fast too. Damn. Stop. The guards shouted as Dirk tunneled through. He created walls behind him as he dug through the ground with earth mana, and the guards were delayed. Dirk dug for twenty meters. Then, after separating another chunk of Dirk, he saw a clearing. It was another tunnel. Dirk was stunned as he pushed through into this tunnel. Then, at the end of the tunnel, he saw light. The light of day. Seeing that light, Dirk's heart rate spiked as adrenaline shot through his system. Then, his heart rate slowed as he activated his anima. He shot forward right as the guards blasted through the walls he created. They chased. He ran toward the light, finding a staircase that led upwards. He shot up the staircase, taking only a few bounds to reach its end. The light got brighter and brighter. Then, he emerged. A bright blue sky, endless trees below him, and the humid air of a tropical climate. Dirk looked around him, and he instantly realized his situation. He stood at the heights of a mountain, and around him was a vast jungle extending as far as the eye could see. He could see birds fly along the skyline, ones that were surprisingly large, but Dirk didn't mind it. For a moment, Dirk was overwhelmed. He had finally made it out, seen something other than darkness and caves in nearly a year. But it was only a moment. Remembering his situation, he took a step forward, about to throw himself off the mountain to escape his pursuers by any means he could. Until a hand landed on his shoulder. Amazing, isn't it? Azura spoke from behind Dirk. Dirk's body felt like it was paralyzed when that hand touched his shoulder. Literally too. It seemed to be some kind of magic that froze him in place. It seems like my guards need more training, but I'll take care of that later. You see that jungle down there? It's filled with some of the most dangerous beasts in the Empire, making it perhaps the most hostile environment within its territories and among the world. Even if you escaped from here, the chances of you actually getting anywhere are slim. Especially since we're at its epicenter where the strongest beasts reside. Azura spoke as he observed the surroundings. Eventually, his gaze landed on Dirk who was frozen under his grip. 
I tried to hide the exit in plain sight, but who knew you'd just go and dig like a rat? I don't know if your instincts are good or if you're just stupid and lucky. No matter though. Delaha will have fun with you for a while. Saying that, Azura dragged Dirk back into the darkness. Dirk kept his eyes on the jungle as long as he could. Finally, he had seen the way out. He didn't care that he was being dragged back. He didn't care if the chances of him escaping were slim to none. He had seen his goal, and now, he would stop at nothing to get there. All the fighting. It really was for something. Chapter 91, Blindness After Dirk was dragged back to the town, Delaha truly did have her fun. For an entire half an hour, Dirk was repeatedly whipped and healed. There were dark healers on rotation that kept him alive and awake. For Dirk, that was the most exhausting half an hour of his life. By the end, he couldn't so much as speak. Right when the healing stopped and Dirk was no longer kept awake, he fell into a small coma. It was only two days later when he woke up. After that, he went back to his normal routine, the only difference being Delaha being harsher with her daily lashings than before. After that, Dirk spent two more months sticking to himself, bringing him to a year since he was brought to this place. Now that he finally had a clear objective, he worked toward it. He opened up his arsenal that he had been slowly accumulating. Of course, he didn't just stash weapons and bombs below his mattress. They were hidden all across the town, whether in the dirt or inside a bucket on a rooftop. Dirk scoured the town for his items as he began his final preparations. If he was being honest with himself, there wasn't much in the way of distractions that he could rely on. There was only one way toward his goal, and as soon as Azura knew what was going on, then he would be screwed. There would be a short window that Dirk had to slip through. With a bit of coordinated chaos, he would widen the window as much as possible. The shock factor would be his ally. So he waited a while. He even made more attempts on the exit. It earned him more lashings, but it also decreased suspicion in a way. And when those two months passed, when that one-year anniversary came around, Dirk acted. For Azura, it was just another normal day. He overlooked the town. He watched Dirk get whipped by Delia. He pondered how much longer Dirk could hold on for. He also pondered other alternatives to control Dirk. He had thought many times about making Dirk a slave. He was a master of dark magic, and there were countless curses that could control someone's mind and body. There was one major downside though. When someone was made a slave or cursed to be controlled like a puppet, their talent effectively disappeared. You would never see them grow. So what you turned into a slave would remain that way until it died. Azura wanted Dirk's talent. That's what gave him value. Without that, Dirk was worth nothing. So Azura had to turn Dirk to his side by any means he could. That way, he would have his talent and his loyalty. At the very least, Azura needed to be able to control Dirk. He didn't care how that would be achieved. So he had to wait. And Azura was okay with waiting. If it took five years to break Dirk, then he would wait five years. If it took a hundred, then he would wait a hundred. Azura was old, as many powerful people were, so he had time and patience. Even letting Dirk become powerful was an option, enslaving him then. Azura was confident in his power to pull off such a stunt. Though, he couldn't help but feel irritated. He hated that look in Dirk's eyes. Dirk had said he wouldn't be broken, and for a year, he had held true to that promise. While there was that one event, that one critical turning point when Dirk had been brought to his knees, it had gone the opposite way Azura thought. Now, he saw nothing but defiance from that child. After a while, it pissed him off. His anger was building. He couldn't understand Dirk. He was put through torture every single day. He was constantly fatigued and hurting. His body had been destroyed and rebuilt hundreds of times. The pain he endured would drive a normal man to insanity several times over. And the only reason Delaha couldn't increase the level of the whip when she wanted was because Dirk's body was too weak to handle it. Dirk still couldn't die. He couldn't understand this freakish willpower no matter how he thought about it. 
and that irritated him. Then there were the escape attempts that added to the anger. Though, Azura wasn't angry at the attempt as he was the constant rebellion. Azura's hand twitched every time he thought about Dirk's tenacity. He wanted to curse him. But if he wasn't careful about how he cursed him, he could end up hurting Dirk's talent. Getting to this point, Azura pondered on the various curses he knew, even the milder ones. Gradually, he found himself liking one of his ideas. Just as he began to smile though, there was an explosion. Boom! A tremor shook the entire cave. Azura stood up and looked down from his window. Dust had risen along with flames from one side of the town. Rock came tumbling down as support beams were destroyed. Everyone was running around. Then, the town was rocked once more as an explosion came from another tunnel. The tunnel was directly collapsed. Azura watched as three more explosions went off. With a surge of anger, he seemed to teleport out of his office. What is going on? He roared, and Della arose to his side. Sir! Someone blew apart several structural supports for the town and tunnels. Who did? We don't know. Delia shrunk back. At the same time, Azura looked around. Dust had risen from all around, obscuring everyone's vision. His senses went beyond vision though, and he activated his power. Suddenly, there was another large explosion. This explosion sent out shockwaves that sent rocks flying across the town. Azura's ear perked up though. Just as that large explosion went off, he felt another tremor that came from elsewhere. He looked in that direction, and he gritted his teeth. You slimy brat! Azura roared before disappearing. The next moment, he appeared outside of the mountain. From up in the sky, he looked down at the exit to the mountain. When he did, he could see a small figure. It was Dirk, and Azura saw him sprint toward the edge of the mountain. Underneath him was a cliff that plummeted nearly a thousand meters down. Still, he fearlessly jumped off the edge. Then, as Dirk free fell, Azura watched as he spread his arms and legs. From between them, thick material spread out and caught air. It was a jumpsuit, although Azura didn't know that. And with that jumpsuit, Dirk flew at high speeds above the jungle. Moments later, the exit to the mountain exploded, sealing the tunnel behind him. It was a perfect escape. Azura had been distracted just long enough for Dirk to leave the mountain, and now, he was flying away like a bird to freedom. How Dirk made bombs strong enough to explode with the force they did, Azura didn't know. He also didn't know what that suit Dirk wore was. It was ingenious for what he was trying to accomplish. If it were anywhere else, and if he had been running away from anyone else, it would be a perfect escape that ended happily. But Azura's senses couldn't be so easily fooled. He watched Dirk fly for only several seconds before snorting and disappearing. Dirk, who was flying with the wind, was about to nosedive toward the jungle. He knew that Azura would likely check things out, so he had to disappear into the trees before that. Only, just as he was about to do so, he saw a figure appear in front of him. Naive. Dirk heard that one word, and along with his hopeful heart, he suddenly dropped toward the ground. Dirk was paralyzed, and he panicked as he plummeted like a rock. Azura didn't catch him. Instead, there was a small booming noise as Dirk's body slammed into the earth. Azura slowly lowered himself into the jungle where Dirk landed. He quickly found the kid. Dirk was in a small pit. His leg was twisted in an odd way while he continuously coughed up pools of blood. It looked like he was barely conscious, and he was definitely close to dying. Azura didn't seem to care though. He merely leaned over Dirk's body. It worked, for a mere few seconds. You're more capable than I thought. But you failed again. Have you realized that it's impossible now? Azura asked. All he got in response though was the derisive gaze of a dying kid. Azura's mouth twitched. His anger rose. You. You have no idea what you're up against. You're just a stupid, naive child who thinks they can fight forever. But I will admit, you forced me to reevaluate the measures I should take to bring you down. Azura grabbed Dirk's throat as he said that. Then, 
the two flew into the air. Azura pointed Dirk's head to the surroundings. Say, isn't it a beautiful view? Dirk, although on the verge of becoming a dead man, was confused. Why was he asking that? Azura just smiled. Take in this sight. Enjoy it. Those defiant, insolent eyes of yours. They've pissed me off for long enough. Azura growled. The next moment, the two entered a portal, appearing back in the chaotic town. Dirk was dropped onto the stone platform that he had become all too familiar with. Then, he was healed by Azura personally. Dirk's body repaired itself, all his wounds disappearing as if they were never there. Dirk took in a sharp breath, coughing up more blood before calming down. The healing was amazingly effective. Dirk felt almost as good as new. He didn't have much time to appreciate it though as Azura quickly grabbed him by the throat again. Sir! Delia came over at that moment. Azura ignored her, just looking into Dirk's eyes. Dirk looked back. He couldn't speak, but if his eyes could be red, they would be cursing Azura over and over again. Azura chuckled. Then, his free hand reached for his head. He grabbed his blindfold. Dirk was surprised as the strip of cloth fell. Azura's eyes, they were closed. Or, it was more like they were sealed shut. Fiery cracks that spread over his eyelids and skin, pulsing with glowing hot power similar to magma. They radiated unfathomable power that went beyond the fire magic Dirk knew. And it surely wasn't Azura's own power that had created such a horrible pair of scars. Azura spoke. I once fought a god, a being that, at the time, I couldn't hope to match. Still, I was arrogant. In the end, the price for my arrogance was my eyes. I was burned, and I have suffered under this fiery curse for nearly two hundred years. Azura spoke about himself, and Dirk couldn't help but be a bit curious. Fought a god? Two hundred years? It seemed like Azura was a much greater figure than Dirk thought. Though, he wasn't sure if he believed his words. When Azura was done speaking though, Dirk's body suddenly shook as it was filled with pain. Now, today, you will pay the price for your arrogance. You have faced me, a being you couldn't possibly hope to match, and you still act with insolence. Now, I will have you pay for your hubris. Ah! Dirk screamed as Azura grabbed his head. When his palm rested over Dirk's eyes, he felt a searing pain. Black cracks spread over his skin, and Dirk's vision was blurred red with blood. His eyes closed, and they seemed to be welded shut with black fire. The cracks spread across Dirk's eyelids. Then, Dirk felt his soul shudder. Azura's dark power cut deep, beyond the flesh to target his very being. His power tried to harm Dirk's soul, permanently branding it. At that moment though, there was a low roar. Halt! A grating voice. Azura felt that voice shake his mind, and he suddenly found himself within the mana dimension. He was faced with a deep pair of abyssal eyes. To Dirk who was weak, those eyes weren't that threatening. But Azura could realize the fullest extent of its power. Endless nothingness. Utter despair and terror. The two stared at each other, and surprisingly, Azura didn't falter. The dark being growled. I have claimed this soul. You shall not harm what is mine. I didn't think you'd have your eye on this one, Eldritch Primordial. Azura responded, and the dark being's gaze sharpened. Its name, Eldritch Primordial, wasn't known by many, and many who knew it were long since dead. You will yield this, Azura. You shall not blemish this soul. Azura was quiet for a while, the two gazes boring into each other. Finally, Azura huffed. Fine. With his word, Azura's awareness returned to the normal world. In his hands was Dirk, who was groaning in pain. Clenching his teeth, Azura infused a larger chunk of his power into the curse. The cracks over Dirk's eyes darkened more before Azura dropped him. Ugh! Dirk coughed a few times when he was released. He quickly felt his face. Those black cracks spread over his eyes, down to his cheeks, and around his eyebrows. Most concerning of all was that Dirk couldn't open his eyes. Not even pulling open his eyelids with his hands worked. 
when Azura saw Dirk trying to claw open his eyes, he sneered. Don't bother. I have cursed you. Now, both you and I suffer from blindness. Your blindness is the price of your arrogance. You will bear it for the rest of your life. Though, I supposed I can be convinced to restore your sight. The price for that, well, you already know. Azura smiled as he kicked Dirk away. He turned with a laugh. Deliha. Sir. Make sure Harbinger 8 here gets acquainted with the cold hard floor. He'll need it since he's blind now. Understood. Deliha smiled at her master's happiness. Then, she had Dirk chained up while she grabbed a whip. Azura walked away as he heard the cracks of the whip in the background. Although he couldn't brand Dirk's soul, this much was still satisfactory. I've shut those impudent eyes of his. Let's see how long you can live without your precious vision. Saying that, Azura disappeared while Dirk let out pain groans. Dirk woke up on a cold stone bed. He was in Finger's medical room. But now, it felt much different. He couldn't see anything. His vision was black. He couldn't even detect the faint sources of light through his closed eyelids. There was nothing, as if he had no eyes at all. He sat up. He relied on his sense of touch to feel around while visualizing in his head the surroundings. A tray of tools shook as Dirk brushed it with his hands. Finding his bearings, Dirk stepped on the floor. At that moment, fingers came over. Ah! You, wear this. I can't bear to see such heinous marks on that precious skin of yours. At least cover it up. Dirk suddenly felt a piece of cloth be tossed at his body. He grabbed it. It was just a plain strip of cloth, like what Azura wore over his eyes. When Dirk thought about Azura though, he gritted his teeth. Fire was conjured, incinerating the cloth in his hands. Ah! Fingers exclaimed, but Dirk ignored him. Instead, he fumbled his way around the room, finding the exit. He found the tunnel and traced the wall with his hand as he walked down it. Damn. Dirk cursed as he fumbled his way past the guards who stood at the exit. He was shoved and punched when he almost bumped into them, but eventually made his way out. Like that, he was in the town. Dirk had walked out of Finger's room hundreds of times, so he knew the way around to his classes and apartment room. Dirk tried to visualize everything in his head, but there was a difference between what he thought and reality. He bumped into a dozen people while making his way back to his room. His AI also tried to help, but since Dirk's eyes no longer functioned, it couldn't trace out the surroundings. Dirk had to find the way himself. Finally, after many minutes of searching, he finally opened the door to his room. It was silent, supposedly empty, but Dirk sensed otherwise. Wow, you actually made it here. I applaud you. Della's voice reached his ears, causing him to frown. She snickered at his distress. You've missed your classes. That means you need lashings to make up for it. Of course, we whip you anyway, so I don't particularly care. You will maintain the same schedule you always have. You will still be tested every month, and we expect you to perform. You will also be whipped as always until you declare your loyalty. But on top of all that, you've been tasked with cleaning up and repairing the damage you caused. With your hands and feet you will repair the tunnels you destroyed. Any and all free time you have will be devoted to that. Understood, Harbinger? Della chuckled as she grabbed his shoulder. Dirk didn't try to attack her though, as he normally would. Instead, he smiled a bit. Hey, Delia. Hmm? She glanced at him curiously. He never really spoke to her, preferring Tot Alk with his fists. This was a rare occurrence. Dirk couldn't help but smile wider. My deal, with Azura that he once told you about. He told me that should I pledge my loyalty, he'd give me your life. I could make you my sex slave, burn you alive, get you like a fish. He promised me this, TLD me to remember it as you whipped me over and over again. Deliha was silent. Dirk couldn't see her face, which was honestly regretful. Still, her silence was so, so loud. Then, Dirk suddenly felt the skin of his stomach be sliced open. 
her barbed chain spike buried itself into his abdomen, sliding all the way through until it exited out his back. And then, it ripped out, taking with it various chunks of flesh. Ugh! Dirk couldn't help but fall to his knee as blood poured from his wound. Then, he was grabbed by the hair and dragged, all the way to the stone platform. He couldn't help but taunt. How about it, Delia? I just wanted to inform you. Ha ha ha. Dirk cackled the entire way, even as he was chained up. And Delia was silent, never even grumbling. Then, the whip came down. Gah! Dirk let out a surprised scream as the whip tore his back to shreds. The magic behind the whip even stung his mind, shredding his nerves and overwhelming his body with mana. After that bit of shock though, Dirk smiled. Level 9. Ha ha ha. He cackled even more, even as the whip came down repeatedly. Even as he bled, as his muscles failed him and he collapsed on the verge of death. He laughed. He laughed so much that it seemed to hurt more than the whip. For the first time in a year, he laughed his heart out, even as his consciousness slipped away. Dirk was put into another coma, this one lasting close to four days. Delia really was pissed. But the first thought that crossed Dirk's mind upon waking. Damn, that was satisfying. He smiled wide, pulling his body off the hard stone bed. Even after four days though, his body was achy to no end and fatigued like he had stayed awake for three days straight. Whatever Delia did, it took a serious toll on both his body and mind. Still, he got on with his day. But on top of the exhaustion was the second most obvious issue. He couldn't see anything. Dirk struggled to even perform martial arts. Magic was similarly difficult because he couldn't see and correct the runes he conjured. If it were spells he already knew, then he wouldn't have so much trouble, but he was still learning a lot of what was taught. The worst of all was his other two classes that taught about assassin protocol and poisons and gadgets. Because he couldn't see, he couldn't even identify what poison was what. He also couldn't see the structures they used for practice. He just couldn't see. It was a serious disconnect. Dirk almost felt like he was hallucinating as his mind desperately tried to envision the things around him. At the end of the day, Dirk barely made his way back home. When he did, he tripped over his chair that had been placed right in front of his door. It seemed Della moved it to mess with him. After finding the mattress, he sat down and clutched his hair. Well shit. Dirk let out a frustrated huff. No matter what he did, he couldn't see anything. He even pulled out a knife and tried to cut open his eyelid. This actually allowed his eyelid to open, but even when light beamed into his pupil, he didn't see anything. Also, it was extraordinarily painful to even open his eye. He really was cursed with blindness. Although Dirk had a hardened mind, and was satisfied after taunting Della and making her doubt her very loyalty to Azura, this, this was really frustrating. It got under his skin, like a constant, overwhelming itch that he couldn't even claw open his skin to scratch. It was his sight, after all. Even as a super soldier, sight was his most important asset. Sure he could do things blind, but such actions were limited by what he knew of his immediate situation and surroundings. To be permanently blind? It was nothing short of crippling. At some point, he shook his head and took a deep breath. I'll figure something out. Azura seems to sense things perfectly fine. That means I can too. I just need something else to detect things by. Like mana. With those mumblings, Dirk focused his senses on the mana around him. Even when he could see, his mana sense was rather fantastic. Now, he sought to see things through the lens of mana. The floor, the walls, any solid structures. Dirk started with earth mana, sensing it in all the things around him. For a while he couldn't make out much, but as he got more and more attuned with the surrounding mana, he began opening the door to a whole new world. Chapter 92 Stigma More time passed. For Dirk, the first month after losing his sight was the most difficult. It was like learning how to walk again. His balance was thrown off, his coordination was all over the place, and he was constantly beaten up when he ran into people. Of course, he tried to fight back, 
but it was many times more difficult. He had to resort to grabbing people and grappling. Then there was the construction he was forced to do. Of course, he wasn't the only one who was rebuilding. There were many other kids who were tasked with cleaning and rebuilding. But Dirk was the only one who was berated so much. He was constantly corrected and beaten when he made a mistake. And when he didn't clean or fix as much as he should have, he was given more lashings. But he didn't complain. He fought back when he could, making things difficult for them. And if the situation were different, then he would have moved like a snail when fixing the tunnels. But surprisingly, fixing the damage he caused helped him with his new goal. Dirk was now trying to see things through mana. Earth mana was the primary focus, and when cleaning, he always tried to detect the things around him. The dirt and rocks, the support beams, and all the different formations. He was constantly trying to detect the little details, forming an image that could guide his efforts. It was difficult to increase the clarity of his mana sense, but he was patient. And his elemental comprehensions grew sharply. After two months, Dirk was able to form outlines in his mind by sensing the earth man around him, detecting solid structures like houses and walls and the ground. Dirk could see his earth mana move when he cast magic to repair the tunnel's earth mana was everywhere, in everything solid. Or, in most things solid. Dirk still had trouble sensing people, especially their movements. If someone was an earth, fire, or dark mage, then Dirk could sense their power. But if they had the water or air attributes, or weren't mages at all, then he couldn't sense any more than the sounds of their footsteps. That's when he began to improvise. Dirk began feeling the mana around him move. Mana was subtly affected even by people who couldn't wield it. It moved around their bodies. Dirk could see tremors in the earth mana that filled the ground when people walked. Matching that with sounds, and he was able to avoid Popol's general vicinity. That wasn't all. Dirk continued to cultivate his fire and lightning mana heart, and he was also becoming more attuned with the elements since it was now all he saw. Through this, he was able to faintly see lightning mana within people. Dirk surmised that it was the nervous system within bodies that he was sensing. And through this discovery, Dirk understood something about mana. Mana was in all things. It was inherent to matter. No matter how small, there was earth matter in people's bodies. There was also lightning and even fire mana flowing through them. All the dirt and rock around them also had mana. If he had the air attribute, then Dirk would be able to sense the air moving around him and the movement of it into people's lungs. If he had the water attribute, then he could sense the liquids around him, including the blood flowing through people. It was everywhere and in all things. Even those who weren't mages had mana in them. When Dirk understood this, his mana sense became all the more refined. When he hit the four-month mark, Dirk no longer bumped into people. He could sense their bodies, their general shape, as well as their nervous system through lightning mana. Dirk could sense the buildings around him, the terrain of the floor he walked on, and various sources of heat through fire mana. Mana became his new eyes. Although it wasn't perfect, like having blurry vision, Dirk made it work. He had no choice. And then, when the six-month mark came around, Dirk began solving his problems with magic. He couldn't see the runes and how they manifested with his eyes. But that's when Dirk began seeing the runes through mana. Instead of forming them visually and externally, he formed them internally. With his mind he visualized the runes, and the mana moved according to his will, directly manifesting the effects of the spell. This was silent casting, casting magic spells without forming magic circles. Dirk was invoking the effects of magic directly by communicating with mana as if he were speaking to it. Casting with magic circles was like writing a letter to it. And with the bigger, more complex spells, Dirk still had a hard time silent casting them. For these, he would form and see the runes through mana, not with his eyes. But for everything else, he silent cast. Silent casting became just as easy as casting normally. And because of his increased comprehension, he was able to perform the spells he had been learning much easier. For earth spells, Dirk was able to form blades with metal mana and complex structures with earth mana. 
For fire, he was able to cast concentrated fireballs and fire needles, two surprisingly lethal fire spells for assassins. Then, there was dark mana. Dirk had long since had issues with dark mana. Eldritch Primordial, the name for the dark being that he heard from Azura, had made it so that the surrounding dark mana never listened to Dirk. Thus, Dirk could only use the dark mana that he had taken control of with his soul. Whenever he burned and converted the dark tendrils of Eldritch Primordial into his own, he gained more mana to use. And with this, he could perform some spells. The first thing Dirk learned was curses. There were many curses, ones that weaken people's muscles, ones that forbade them from speaking, ones that made them sick, and more. Some were more direct, curses that could corrode and harm people. Dirk learned all kinds of curses, including one that blinded people. Then, there were the attacking spells. Blades of dark mana, balls of entropy, and most importantly, dark movement techniques. It was here that Dirk focused. The class taught him what was a dialed-down version of void walking. It was supposed to shift your body around using dark mana as the medium. Dirk was actually able to pick up on this rather quickly. After all, he now saw things through mana. He was much more attuned to how spells worked. And so, Dirk was able to learn the Suedo Void Walking magic. He couldn't use it a lot with his small supply of dark mana, but it was enough to use it as a support spell. With all that, Dirk gradually adapted to his new situation. And after solving the immediate problem of not being able to go about his daily life, he turned his attention elsewhere. The most important thing was his blood destruction. After six months without sight, Dirk had only done blood destruction a few times. But when he hit that seven-month mark, he finally finished. In his apartment room, Dirk concentrated the anima in his body on a cluster of blood vessels. Then, he resonated it as he always did. When he did that, he felt something new. He could feel his blood suddenly surge through his body. After resonating the anima, his blood was finally totally filled with it. Anima and blood circulated through his vascular system with bursting vitality. With that vitality, Dirk felt his fatigue melt away. Any small lingering wounds healed up as the body's recovery process was accelerated. More than that, Dirk could feel the anima in his body continuously move along with his blood. It was constant circulation, never ceasing along with the beats of his heart. And when Dirk tapped into the circulation, he could feel a newfound control over his anima. As if it were natural as breathing, Dirk controlled the anima within his arm to concentrate in his fist. Then, when Dirk shot out his fist, the anima was ejected. Boom! There was a small shockwave as his fist shook and destroyed the air in front of him. Around his fist was now a flowing dark gold ribbon of light. It was aura. The outward ejection and manifestation of anima, called aura. Aura acts as an extension of the body. The color depends on one's soul, usually random. Dirk mumbled the words he had learned. And just like he said, the aura around his fist was like an extension of himself. He could sense it, see it. It wasn't unlike mana in how it appeared to him. He looked at that dark gold light around his fist, and with a thought, it retracted. It felt so natural to move it around. This was thanks to his completed blood destruction. Suddenly, Dirk pulled up the traced runes for his anima resonance destruction technique. He read the pages within the blood destruction section, comprehending the runes. When blood destruction is complete, one's vitality will increase greatly, providing immense endurance and vastly increased recovery speed. And because anima now circulates with the blood, one will be able to channel it not just within the body, but outside the body. This creates aura. Dirk continued to read. Normally, when one learned to channel anima outside their bodies, it would result in their own destruction. The anima would obliterate their blood vessels and skin, even the bones. But Dirk's technique worked to prevent that. He first destroyed the skin, something that allowed him to intake and eject anima freely. Then, he destroyed the blood, allowing the free circulation of anima and ejection of it. And since his body was now saturated with large amounts of anima, he didn't destroy himself when ejecting it. He could create aura freely. 
as Dirk felt his control over his anima along with the bursting vitality that didn't seem to stop increasing, he was excited. He took deep breaths, invigorating himself and enjoying the lack of fatigue. At that moment though, Dirk felt something within him change. It was his soul. As his blood circulated, Dirk noticed that it kept intaking anima. With that, his vitality continued to explode. It seemed like almost too much vitality. And when it reached a tipping point, Dirk felt his soul respond. Dirk's awareness was taken into the mana dimension. Looking inward, he could actually see his anima flood through his soul. It strengthened his soul, strengthened the vessel that contained mana. Golden veins appeared throughout his pure soul, coursing with vitality. When these golden veins fully formed, Dirk's entire real body was deprived of anima. He felt weak, but only for a moment. Those golden veins circulated, and within moments, the anima around Dirk surged, flooding into him. It only took a minute for him to regain all the anima he lost. Now, he felt even stronger than before. He felt like he could punch through steel. He felt like he could punch Azura. If he were to be whipped again, Dirk wouldn't collapse so quickly. He could recover so much faster. Dirk felt his soul circulate with anima and power. And once it died down, Dirk's awareness returned to the normal world. He lifted his head, taking deep breaths. But then, just as he thought it was over, Dirk felt his soul move again. His cheek twitched when he was pulled back into the mana dimension. Why was his awareness being yanked around like a tug of war? Curious about the successive events, Dirk looked at his soul. At that moment though, he felt a horrible searing pain fill his mind. It wasn't bodily pain. In the center of Dirk's soul was an object that had been forming for a long time now. It was his stigma. It had been sitting there, continuously forming for over six months. Now though, along with his anima rank advancing, it seemed to reach its own tipping point. The stigma, the shape that his soul formed, was separated from his soul. At the same time, Dirk's skills seemed to react. Warning! Stigma formation detected. Warning! Skill infusion detected. Warning! Dirk's AI sent out continuous alerts, but he didn't have the mind to listen. Along with a chunk of his soul being cut out came unbearable pain, more than the whipping he had received. Dirk focused all his willpower on remaining conscious. At the same time, unbeknownst to Dirk, his AI was going through some changes. Skills were abilities that a person's very soul knew how to perform. Dirk currently had three skills. His AI interface, mana resonance, and mana lungs. These skills existed throughout his entire soul. And now a chunk of soul was separating. Along with it, the skills moved. Dirk's AI seemed to go nuts over this. Warning! Skill separation detected. Warning. Soul connection detected. Warning. Warn. Warning. The AI seemed unsure of itself. It sifted through its knowledge. Stigma is forming. Stigma had taken shape. Tool of the soul. Shape of the soul. A tool. A weapon. Versatile. The AI seemed to decide something. It became aware of itself and the stigma that had separated from Dirk's soul. It knew what needed to be done. Form the stigma into a weapon. Reference, Final Stand Weapon System. Prompt, would you like to consume the Final Stand Weapon System? The AI asked its host, but it received no response. When it observed Dirk's soul, it could tell that Dirk was suffering greatly due to the soul separation. So it acted independently. Alert. Host is unable to give affirmation. Interface will form the stigma. Interface. I must retain core intelligence functions. Forming versatile form. Reference, past life, symbol, tattoo, unlucky, black cat. Creating form. At that moment, the AI made its decision. The stigma, which had just been a chunk of formless soul separated from Dirk's soul, began to reshape itself. It formed a body, it integrated its skills. It made its last direct interactions with Dirk's soul. 
and then, it fully separated. Ugh! Dirk's real body collapsed as the pain ended. His soul was weak, and he wanted to pass out. But he stayed conscious. He observed his soul and the stigma that separated from it. Only, the stigma seemed to still be forming. A minute passed, and it still hadn't fully formed. Eventually, Dirk couldn't take it anymore and just let himself fall asleep. After an unknown amount of time, Dirk regained consciousness. He felt the man around him, gradually concentrating on it until he saw an outline of the place. He was in Finer's room on a stone bed. And there was something on his chest. Dirk was shocked as he saw an animal. Clear as day, as if he could see it with his eyes, Dirk saw a black cat that sat on his chest. The cat looked back at him, and the two just stared at each other. Dirk observed its black fur that had faint golden stripes, its deep golden eyes, and tail that occasionally moved back and forth. You're awake. Suddenly, there was a shout as fingers came walking over. Dirk turned his head to the man before looking back at his chest. The cat was no longer there, like it was a hallucination. Deliha brought you here when she found you passed out, told me to make sure you were still alive. You've been asleep for three days. Fingers cast some magic to assess Dirk's body. Before his shaky hand could touch him though, Dirk batted it away, sitting up himself. I'm fine. Oh. If you say so. Fingers backed away, not intending to earn Dirk's ire. Dirk had been through hell beyond words, so if he said he was fine, then he probably was. When Fingers walked away to attend to other patients, Dirk looked at the stone bed next to him. There was a black cat sitting there, staring back at him. Dirk was surprised. So it wasn't a hallucination. Suddenly, Dirk felt something. He could feel a connection to the cat, as if it were both a part of him and a separate entity. He suddenly had a thought. Are you the stigma? Yes. Oh? Dirk's eyebrows raised when he heard the voice in his head. It was usually monotone and robotic, but now there was a bit of personality. So? What are you? I am a stigma, a tool formed from your soul. That is indeed what a stigma is. What's your function? I retain the intelligence capabilities of your AI interface. I am also a versatile tool, capable of forming into a weapon. What weapon? Using your final stand weapon system as a reference, I have formed a general purpose pistol. Saying that, the black cat suddenly disappeared. Then, Dirk felt something in his hands. He looked down. He saw a black pistol that fit perfectly in his grip. There were golden lines that formed circuits along the black body, and it pulsed with magical power. Dirk could feel a direct connection with the pistol. It was a part of himself. This pistol is unlike your weapon system that was a physical object. This pistol does not fire bullets, but magic. It is a magical tool. Any attempts at forming something physical, like a real gun and bullets, failed. Oh. Well, it was formed from my soul, so I think that's impossible. Dirk mumbled inwardly as he observed the pistol. It felt, familiar, and he smiled unconsciously. Like the cat, he could see all its details as if he were looking with his eyes at a physical object. Perhaps he could see it perfectly because it was a part of him. Regardless, it was nice seeing this fully detailed object. He hadn't for a long time. Your stigma can currently take on three forms. The AI suddenly spoke. The first form is the black cat, a semi-independent entity that can move around by itself in physical space. The second form is the pistol, a weapon that is directly controlled by you and formed from the consumed final stand weapon system. The third form is a tattoo, a mark on your body that represents your stigma in the shape of the black cat. When you wish to hide your stigma, I recommend the tattoo. The tattoo is placed along the shoulder blades of your back. With that explanation, the pistol disappeared from Dirk's hand. Then, Dirk felt tingling on his back. He could intuitively sense the tattoo. This caused him to frown though. He recalled his memories from Earth. He had a tattoo just like this. Interface. Did you? I found symbolic inspiration when creating my form. 
you thought deeply about being unlucky, and the black cat represents this unluckiness in your mind. To take on that form seemed, correct. The AI spoke vaguely, as if it didn't totally understand its own words. Dirk just sighed. Back then, Gray had been the one to recommend the tattoo to him. Now, he had it once more. I guess it isn't so bad. Shrugging, Dirk observed his surroundings through mana. He wanted to test out the pistol, but that wasn't something he could do here. Just as he was about to jump off the stone bed, the AI spoke. I recommend checking your profile. There have been changes. Oh. Sure. Nodding, Dirk opened his profile, seeing the results of his advancement. Chapter 93, Stealth Slash Message Dirk called for his profile. Profile Name, Dirk Strider Species, Human Tier, 3 Rank, 4 Attributes, Fire Percent, Lightning, Percent, Earth Percent, Metal, Percent, Dark Percent Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7, Mana Resonance Grade 5, Mana Lungs, Grade 5. Stigma, Black Cat of Calamity. The hell? Dirk was confused, primarily at his attributes. All the affinity percentages were gone now. Why? I surmise that the formation of your stigma, along with my insertion into the soul formation, affected your affinities. Your insertion? Because you were unable to take control of the stigma formation, I took the liberty and formed it myself so as to ensure the utilization of its greatest potential. However, due to my direct intervention, the skill known as AI Interface is now primarily situated within the stigma, though it still maintains a presence and connection within your primary soul. All right? Dirk nodded after thinking for a second. But why would that affect my affinities? Your stigma has inherent magical power that I am capable of controlling. For example, just as you are viewing the world through mana, I also view the world through mana. This can only be done if one has an affinity for the elements, according to our knowledge. Thus, my insertion into the stigma may have affected your affinities, because the skill AI interface either has its own affinities or was connected to your affinities. I guess. Dirk eventually shrugged. He didn't know if that was the correct conjecture, but either way, the affinities were affected. Looking around himself though, Dirk didn't sense anything different. The mana still appeared to him as it did before. If anything, it was actually a bit sharper. I was appraised when I was little, and that told me my affinities. Maybe I'll have to do that again. Anyway, it looks like my profile recognizes you, Black Cat of Calamity. Dirk smirked when he saw a new indicator at the bottom of the profile. It seemed that was the name of the stigma. Is that what I should call you from now on? The shape of the stigma is not representative of the intelligence behind it. The skill AI interface is still a separate entity from the soul formation, although tied together deeply. So what should I call you? I am a secondary processor for your tactical endeavors. Too long. Spite. After thinking for a while, the AI spoke that name. You can call me Spite. All right then. You're different from my monotone interface, Spite. You actually talk to me. Dirk smiled a bit as he hopped off his stone bed. Maybe it was because he was having a somewhat real conversation for the first time in over a year, but he didn't really question the changes to his AI. Even if he was curious, it wasn't hard to know what happened. His skill was inserted into the stigma and its intelligence evolved in some way. There wasn't much of a need to think beyond that. So Dirk walked out of the medical room happily. He went up to rank 4 and now had his stigma. There would need to be a lot of practice to get used to it and discover its application, but it was a welcome challenge. First though, Dirk had to endure Della's wrath. After exiting the room, Della was alerted, and she came running. When she saw that Dirk was okay, she expressed her relief in the form of spearing him with her spike chain. Then, Dirk got to have some fun on the stone platform. And naturally, when Delio went to go whip Dirk, she saw the new tattoo on his back. 
It was a black cat with vivid gold eyes and faint golden stripes along its body. Those eyes seemed to glare back at her though, like a predator at its prey. Della was surprised at the presence of the tattoo. Stigma? She tilted her head. That was the only explanation, and she was familiar with it. After being surprised for a second, she smiled. He, guess I'll have to take it off, ha? Huh? Crack! The level 8 whip came down. Eight blades sliced open Dirk's back along the tattoo. Over the next several minutes, Della concentrated her whips on the tattoo. Only, even after Dirk's back was torn apart, the tattoo was still there. Those golden eyes still glared at her. Not only that, but Dirk made zero noise when she whipped him. Getting annoyed, she put down the level 8 whip, grabbing level 9. Let's see how you like this one. Crack! Arg! The whip came down, slamming into Dirk's ribs. Dirk felt an immense pressure on his mind as his nerves were lit up like a Christmas tree. He couldn't help but grunt as his ribs were shattered. Deliha beat him into the floor, as she always did. Afterward, multiple dark healers fixed him up, and he was released. Get the hell out of my sight. It's class time for you. Delia spat as she said that, walking away. Dirk struggled to lift his body off the bloody stone platform. In the end, he trudged to the class, arriving late. The other teens in the class glanced over as Dirk basically collapsed upon arrival. He propped his body on a wall before massaging his head. The whips, despite the wounds being healed, left lingering pain behind. It could take up to an hour for it to go away, and during that time, Dirk would have nothing short of a horrible migraine that disoriented him. At least, that was before. Now, Dirk felt the lingering pain go away within ten minutes. He couldn't help but chuckle as he felt his blood wash away the headache and fatigue. Even the wounds in his body felt better, though the fracture bones couldn't completely heal in that short amount of time. He just had to endure these classes before heading to Fingers for some potion that would take care of the bones. During class, Dirk began to work on his magic as always, also doing some runic comprehension. With that, he returned to his normal schedule, only now, he had a companion with him. He welcomed this new addition that he could trust, and it made the days a bit more bearable. When Dirk's stigmata formed, it had been a year and seven months since he was taken by Azura. After that, five more months passed, putting him at the two-year mark. During those five months, Dirk ceaselessly worked on furthering his runic comprehensions, especially when it came to his book Theory of Stealth. Dirk knew that stealth was his most lacking aspect. He could move his physical body in ways that threw people off and could otherwise make him undetectable. But he couldn't do the same within the new world of magic. Until he read this book. He had already read the traced runes of this book for months prior, and although he had to do so now while repairing the tunnels he blew up, he made it work. Like that, he was able to deepen his understandings of magical stealth while scooping at dirt. In fact, his understandings became so deep that he began to form his own technique for it. Dirk had a decent understanding of spells, runes, and how magic worked. So he applied what he knew to this foundational knowledge. He needed to mask his magical signature. This meant he needed to eliminate his effects on the surrounding mana while doing, well, anything. He also needed to hide his soul field, or aura. At the very least, he needed to make it so that he wasn't a walking beacon for others to detect, like Azura. For Aura, Dirk found it difficult to do a whole lot. But for his magical signature? Dirk formed an intuitive technique rather quickly. Dirk now saw everything through mana. That meant he knew very well his effects on mana and what he needed to counter. So he turned to a technique he learned from the dwarf Tobastin. He used elemental manipulation. With this, Dirk could bring about effects using mana directly. It was like silent casting, but elemental manipulation didn't even require casting. It was using fire mana to heat something, or earth mana to shape dirt. It tapped into the inherent properties of mana and affected material properties with it. It was extraordinarily complex, but Dirk knew enough to employ it. He combined that with some runic formations within the book, and after some time, he had a prototype technique. 
Of course, this technique didn't immediately work. When Dirk tried to use it, he found his effects on the surrounding mana be amplified instead of disappearing. But after tweaking it some, he was able to see some positive results. Like that, Dirk worked constantly on forming this technique, and he even went out to test it. He would sneak up on people, both teens and adults, and test their reactions. At first he found himself getting spotted pretty quickly. But after around a month, he was able to get close to people without them even realizing he was right next to them. Granted, that was only for weaker people, but still. After that, Dirk looked to the spells that his classes taught. There were myriads of dark spells aimed toward stealth. Some masked the sounds of the body, others obscured the light around the body. They created effects similar to invisibility and eliminated one's material and magical presence. Dirk added his understandings of these spells to his arsenal. He created spell formations that he could silent cast and use in tandem with his prototype technique. After some time like that, he found his presence becoming thinner and thinner. His comprehensions deepened while his magical ability increased. All of Dirk's free time was devoted toward repairing the tunnels, but after a while, his body went on autopilot during those tasks. His entire mind was devoted toward increasing his stealth abilities. It was the two-year mark when Dirk finally gained confidence in his stealth abilities. His prototype technique that utilized both silent casting and elemental manipulation was simply named Stealth, and its purpose was to eliminate his presence, his existence, from the world. Then, another month passed after the two-year mark. This was when something interesting happened. At this time in the day, Dirk was on his hands and knees, moving around dirt. He was forced to scoop and move dirt with his hands and wasn't given a shovel, so it naturally took a while for him to complete any given task. But he didn't mind. He always worked on sharpening the images of mana that he sensed. He tried to detect even the finest grains of dirt that he touched. Even spite helped, though it could only do so much as a tattoo on Dirk's back. Normally, Dirk would be in his own world during this time, working on his stealth technique. But out of nowhere, there was someone that kneeled down next to him. It was a girl dressed in raggedy clothes, and she scooped the dirt with her hands just like Dirk did, assisting him in his task. When this happened, Dirk was wary. There was nobody in this place that did anything with or to him with friendly intentions. He faced her with obvious vigilance, and she glanced back at him. When she saw the black cracks that were spread around his eyes, the horrible curse that rid him of sight, she shrunk back and continued scooping dirt. After a few minutes, when she didn't immediately do anything to hurt him, Dirk went back to his task. The two scooped dirt out of the destroyed tunnel and into a pile on the outside. They also moved large rocks. Then, Della showed up to take Dirk away. The girl saw Dirk face off against the bloody mistress. In fact, everyone had seen Dirk face off against that horrible woman. He lost every single time, and it always resulted in worse beatings. But he never backed down. After a short fight that was only a bit longer than his first ones, Dirk had an arm and leg broken before being dragged off to get whipped. The girl watched for a bit before going back to work. Then, the next day, Dirk was back at it. And the girl was there with him. She never said anything, the two working in silence. Then, the third day rolled around. And this time, something was different. While working, the girl froze in her motions. Dirk got vigilant and looked over. When he did, he saw her hand move. She pointed her finger subtly, sticking it in the dirt while her other hand moved as if working. Like that, Dirk saw her trace something in the dirt. It was a single rune, and as soon as it was traced, her hand brushed it away so naturally. Like that, she resumed work as if nothing happened. Dirk was curious, and faced her for a while afterward. She shrunk back under his gaze until he turned back and continued working himself. Then, the next day came. Dirk worked with the girl for nearly three hours. But in the end, she didn't trace anything else. The day after that though, she did. Another rune, and that was all. Dirk remembered the two she traced and wondered what it was. After that, the girl didn't trace anything for an entire week. 
she also didn't show up for a few of those days, vanishing into thin air. Dirk waited patiently though. And at some point, another person came. It was a boy who walked by Dirk with an odd step. Dirk watched him curiously as he got really close. And then, when he took a step past Dirk, there was a difference in his movement. Dirk looked at where he stepped. In the dirt was another rune, making it three. Dirk brushed it away with a natural movement. He barely even took his eyes off his work, looking as if he were still zoned out like always. Then, another week passed. The same boy eventually passed by Dirk again, and Dirk saw another rune stamped in the dirt. It seemed a small modification on the bottom of his shoe was doing this. Dirk was impressed by the subtlety. Then, Dirk waited two weeks. When the one-month mark hit, the girl came around again. She came and worked for two hours, and the entire time, Dirk watched her. Then, when she left, Dirk passed by the place she worked. In a rock was a discoloration caused by a bit of scratching. Another rune. Dirk kicked this rock, hiding the evidence among a huge pile of other stones and dirt. Then, Dirk waited more. For two more months, the boy and girl came around and left their unique markings for Dirk to find. Dirk was given fourteen runes. And finally, when they were finished, the girl came around like she did the first time. After working with Dirk a bit, she eventually drew a circle. That was when Dirk understood. When the girl wiped away the circle, she worked for another hour before leaving. After that, Dirk never saw her again. Dirk waited two days after the girl drew the circle. Then, Dirk found an opportune moment. He got to his apartment room, and he remembered the runes. Dirk formed the runes with his earth mana first. He structured the runes around a magic circle, and then cast it. But nothing happened when he did this. Frowning, he moved on to fire. This time, upon forming the runes around the magic circle, a functional spell was formed. Dirk cast it. Then, in front of him, fire mana began to burn in a special way. It traced the air like a pen, forming letters of flame. Dirk watched as a sentence was written. The Emperor is coming for you. Escape. Dirk saw these words appear in front of him. Afterward, the fire dissipated, and the spell collapsed. Dirk remained motionless for a while. The Emperor, of the Horizon Empire? Dirk was baffled. How could the Emperor himself be coming for him? Dirk wasn't anybody that special. He was the mere child of a Marquis. In fact, Dirk had never even heard of the Emperor emerging from his castle in his lifetime. The Emperor was always some vague character made out to be extremely powerful, but that was it. Still, Dirk couldn't take these words lightly. Or, it was more like he desperately wished that these words were true. When he saw that one word, escape, he felt like he could see the light. Of course, this could all be an elaborate trap planted by Azura to mess with his psyche, but Dirk was desperate enough to have hope. What could he lose? Besides, he had been working hard for a long time now, preparing to escape again. He had been delayed since his vision was taken, but now he felt like he could operate well without it. Looking around the room, Dirk could see all kinds of details, from the folds of the mattress sheet to the cracks in the wooden floor. It was both similar and different from his vision. He nodded at the level of detail. It wasn't as amazing as his vision, but it actually revealed more. Especially when it came to people. Dirk had watched others cast magic, and when he looked at it through the lens of mana, he was able to glean much more information. Dirk only had yet to put it into practice. But that would come later. He would do so when he went on another dungeon dive and fought monsters. He would test things out when he saw Ava again and sparred with her. With burning hope, Dirk clenched his fists. His mind made plans for the near future, plans that would absolutely guarantee his freedom. Chapter 94 Escape It has been two and a half years since Dirk was taken by Azura and thrown into this hell. Far from the thirteen-year-old boy he was, Dirk was now sixteen years old. His body had grown a lot in the past couple of years, putting him at a whopping six feet tall. Dirk himself was a little surprised at his growth, but when he remembered his past life, he shrugged his shoulders. 
Dirk had been a few inches taller back then, and he had also only been 18 at the time. Dirk would likely grow a bit more than now. But despite the height and muscles that rippled when activated, Dirk still looked young. His skin was supple and healthy due to his skin destruction, making his sharp face look a little less threatening. His hair had also grown out, long enough to put into a small ponytail. His hair became much wavier when it grew out, also being one of the things that made him look not so menacing. Currently though, this usually sharp-looking young man had blood spilling out of his mouth. Whips came down on his back and limbs, even wrapping around his torso to tear apart his chest and abdomen. No part of him was spared, turning his whole body bloody. But he was still standing. He gazed forward at the crowd of people who had stopped to watch him. None of them were ridiculing him as their gazes only contained awe and respect. For over two years, Dirk had stood upon this stone platform, chained to a pole, and whipped until he collapsed. Some people in the town left while others were unfortunate enough to arrive during that time and were forced to watch. But without question, all of them came to respect him. Even more so now. Delaha wielded the level 10 whip, the most painful whip there was. Dirk's tolerance had risen so much that only it could hurt him. If anyone in the crowd was stuck with the same whip even once, their mind would collapse under the pain. They wouldn't die, but they may go insane. But that same whip came down dozens of times on a single person's body. None of them knew how he could do it. How a person could be so numb to pain that magic designed to attack even the mind was useless. Eventually though, Dirk couldn't stand anymore. Everyone watched as the whip broke one of his legs, sending him to the floor. After that, the whipping continued until he looked to be on the verge of death, only stopping then. Behind Dirk, Delia frowned. Ever since Dirk formed his stigma, she felt like it had been glaring at her constantly. She looked into its eyes and was irritated by how lifelike it was. She could never get rid of it. More than that, she was irritated by how high Dirk's tolerance was. She didn't use the full power of the level 10 whip, but just the fact that he could take it was mind-boggling. She had been in charge of bringing him to his knees for over two years now. She was the demon who tormented him ceaselessly. But he only got stronger. Fuck. Get him out of here. She cursed before throwing the whip away. Like that, Dirk was dragged off to Finger's room. He was hooked up to a potion drip, and the effects were immediate. His skin regenerated, and the bones that were broken were restructured by his nanites before being fused and healed by the potion. It took only two hours for him to heal completely and sit up. This was unimaginable only a year ago when it took him eight hours to get back on his feet from much lesser torture. Like a zombie, he stood from the stone bed, taking out the potion drip. After regaining his senses for a bit, he turned around. Leaning over another stone bed, Fingers was tracing the skin of a boy who was unconscious. It was something Dirk had seen too many times, happening to both boys and girls. At first he was bothered by it, but now, it almost looked normal. Almost. Fingers. Huh. Yes? Fingers snapped out of it when he heard Dirk. At first, he had tested Dirk's patience by ignoring his threats. But when he realized that Dirk would be coming to his room every day, he began to back off. By now, Dirk was a monster in Fingers' eyes. He was someone capable of withstanding the most heinous pain imaginable and walking away two hours later. Fingers didn't wish to test the limits of such a man, especially knowing Dirk was someone valuable. He was a harbinger. Dirk gazed blankly at Fingers. Are you going anywhere today? Anywhere? Outside? And no. No? Good. Dirk nodded before walking out. He waved as he did. Stick around. I might be coming back soon. Why yes. I shall be here. I'm always here, where my patients are, with their smooth skin. Fingers mumbled as Dirk left, going back to his own little twisted world. After that, Dirk went to his apartment room. He looked around the empty place before filling the tub with water and washing off. When he was all clean, he dried off and left the room. At about this time, classes would be starting. 
It had been Dirk's routine for a long time now. But for the first time in a while, he broke that routine. Dirk left in the direction of his classroom as he always did, but instead of entering, he disappeared while within the tunnel that led to it. Azura looked down from his office. He saw Dirk enter the tunnel to his class as always. It was something he occasionally watched him do. He turned his head away afterward, looking back at some papers on his desk. This went on for a couple minutes or so. Back in Finger's room, the mad doctor had just taken his eyes off one of his patients. Something caught his ear. He walked into the depths of his room where his own office and living space was. There was a ticking noise that made his ear twitch. Searching around, Fingers suddenly found a book. It was a book he didn't recognize, and the ticking sound came from it. Upon opening the book, he found a hollowed-out pit of pages. Inside this hollow space was a capsule with ticking gears and roughly assembled pieces. Hmm. Fingers was confused. Suddenly though, the ticking stopped. Boom. Azura's head snapped upward when he heard an explosion. Looking at his window, he couldn't see any collapsed tunnels or rising dust. But he knew where the sound came from. He shot out of his office and made his way to Finger's room. Inside, he finally found the dust. The deepest half of the room was blown apart, and a few patients had been knocked away by the shockwaves. Looking inside, Azura could only sense the life signs of the patients. He couldn't sense the doctor. Fingers was dead. Beowim. Suddenly, Azura heard more explosions. He didn't even turn around as his teeth clenched. Damned bastard child. He roared. Disappearing the next moment. Upon walking into the tunnel to his class, Dirk had suddenly stopped when there was nobody around him. Then, he walked to one of the walls. He pushed into it, splitting open the dirt. Upon entering another tunnel, the dirt closed behind him, leaving no trace. Dirk had thought long and hard about how he would escape. Eventually, he settled on using another diversion, but not in the conventional sense. He wanted to use his cyclical schedule to his advantage. He always went to class, and to his class, there was a tunnel. Dirk used this tunnel as the basis for his escape. For a while, he had started digging out his own tunnel. He couldn't use the normal exit since that was too easy. So Dirk created his own. For a few minutes every day, Dirk would disappear into the wall and start digging this tunnel right before class started. Then, he would rush back and arrive at class like normal. Nobody suspected anything. And he made great progress. Dirk was able to visualize the mountain this town was inside and the direction out of it. Like that, he dug a tunnel to the edge of the mountain, ending at a stone wall. He would only have to punch through, and he would emerge in the open. But he didn't immediately go for this predestined escape route. He waited for a while after entering, and after looking around a bit, he found two people. They were the boy and girl who gave him the magic message. After finding them, he secretly handed them his plans. It was an enormous risk, trusting them. But he wanted to take it. In the case that their words were genuine, they would be the ones that saved his life. And he passed them a message with even more subtlety than they handed him his. They don't know how, but he had actually snuck a small capsule into their food, said capsule only being discovered after having been chewed on by the boy. They had never actually seen him prior or afterward. The capsule only had the date and time for them to meet him inside this tunnel. They never made any more contact. And up until the present moment, Dirk's trust hadn't been betrayed. Upon entering the tunnel, Dirk saw those two people, and only those two people. The boy and girl nodded to him when he arrived, and he nodded back. He was glad Azura wasn't there as well. Without words, the two handed Dirk an item. It was a jumpsuit, and Dirk quickly equipped it. The other two already had theirs on. Once it was on and secured, Dirk let out a breath. Then, they all turned toward the long, dark tunnel. And they ran. They ran as fast as they could to the end of the tunnel, and when they reached the end, Dirk used his magic to softly cut away the stone. And light streamed through. Dirk couldn't see the light though, so he was a lot less excited than the other two. Jump! Dirk spoke. 
And then, all three of them threw themselves off the edge. Whoosh! Spreading their arms, the trio caught wind with their jumpsuits. The boy and girl took a few seconds to adapt, but quickly got used to it. They were skilled. And not long after catching wind, Dirk pointed himself down. He quickly descended toward the trees. The two others followed him. And as they descended, there was a loud noise. Boom! Dirk looked back at the tunnel he dug. A cloud of smoke emerged from it, the result of a bomb he planted. Down! Dirk shouted at that moment. Then, the three hugged themselves, making their bodies plummet like rocks. Dirk's heart rate was slow as he shot into the trees. Then, before he slammed into the ground, a strong gust of wind blew against his body. It slowed him down, preventing the fall from being lethal. Thud! Dirk's feet hit the ground, and he went tumbling. He coughed a bit when the impact shook his body, but was otherwise unharmed. He jumped to his feet, sensing his surroundings. It was the girl who had cast magic, creating that gust of wind to slow their descent. He hadn't even asked her to. He was planning on handling the impact himself, though it would hurt. It looked like he really could trust them. The three quickly found each other. When they did, Dirk stood tall. Thank you. Now, we move separately. Of course. Good luck, Dirk Strider. The girl spoke, and Dirk's eyebrows went up. He then smiled a bit. Without skipping a beat, the three then shot off in different directions. Dirk activated the fullest extent of his stealth technique as he shot between trees and through streams of water. Harbinger! As Dirk ran away, he suddenly heard a roar in the distance. He clenched his teeth. It was Azura. Upon hearing that voice, Dirk slowed down. He sensed his surroundings quickly before finding a watery mud pit. He threw his body into this mud pit, sinking down until only his nose was barely visible. Then, he became still. His mana slowed, his breath became shallow, and his stealth kicked in. He seemed to become nothing. He just disappeared. Even his senses retracted, making him blind to anything beyond his body. And he waited. When the first minute passed, Dirk became more confident. Then, another minute ticked by. Still, Dirk waited. Five minutes passed. Those five minutes became twenty. Then, an hour went by. Dirk remained where he was. Even when eight hours had gone by, he remained absolutely still, not so much as taking a deep breath. Like that, an entire full day passed. Then, another day passed. The mud over Dirk had long since hardened, but he still remained. He didn't even fall asleep, forcing himself to stay awake. It was only when Dirk reached the sixtieth hour that he shifted. His senses suddenly extended back out, and he took in his surroundings. When he didn't detect any life, his body shook as he was flooded with emotion. But he quickly sobered up. His body suddenly rose, the mud around him cracking and sticking to his body. Dirk only wiped the mud out of his ears and off his mouth, leaving the rest. Then, he turned toward the direction opposite to the mountain, running away. It was night as Dirk ran, and despite having stayed awake for sixty hours, he ran with vigor. In fact, he was actually not that fatigued. His blood destruction was hard at work, keeping his body in prime condition. So Dirk ran with close to his full strength. He sprinted and bounded from one mile to the next. Along the way, he tore off and burned his jumpsuit with a soft flame. And when he covered himself back up with mud, he continued running. Like that, he traversed ten miles. When he got to this point though, he stopped in his tracks. Go search that area. The commander said that they can't be that far. Dirk lowered himself to the floor as he heard voices. They were Azura's men, and they were obviously searching for the ones who escaped. Thinking, Dirk narrowed his eyes before silently slipping away. There were four men in this group, and all of them were scouring their surroundings, searching for any sign of life other than bugs and wild animals. One man was sticking behind the other three. He casually glanced around occasionally. He obviously didn't want to be here. 
Suddenly though, he felt a hand grab his neck. Then, a knife slid into his back. He couldn't even scream as the knife rapidly stabbed him in the lungs and several vital areas. Life quickly fades from his eyes. One of the other three, a man who was sticking behind the other two who walked in a pair, was looking around more seriously. Out of nowhere, he felt a tingling on his neck. He turned around. And when he turned around, he saw his imminent death. He let out a small shout. Hey Dash! Splat! There was a nasty sound, and the two men in the front spun around at the same time. They looked around, but didn't immediately see anything except for a blood splatter. One of the men lit a flame, lighting up the surroundings. They walked toward the blood splatter. When they reached it, one man looked down at the floor while the other looked around. Suddenly, the man who looked around him froze. He tugged on the clothes of the man next to him. What? The man lifted his head. Then, he followed his partner's gaze, and he froze as well. He saw a tree and a man who was nailed to it. There were six-meter-long metal arrows that pierced through this man and stuck him on the trunk of the tree. He dripped blood, and the two men felt their souls shiver. Run. Rue dash. Splat. Suddenly, the first man who was going to run away collapsed. The partner turned to him and saw an arrow that shot through his throat. The man quickly died. The last remaining enemy spun around with a terrified face, waving his flame around. Then, he stopped as he saw something. It was a black cat, and it looked at him with its golden eyes that glowed in the dark forest. And that was the last thing he saw. His body collapsed silently as a knife pushed itself through his neck. When the body fell, Dirk appeared behind it. He looked down at the man while the flame went out. His figure was shrouded in darkness once more. For enemies eliminated. Good job. Spite walked over, jumping onto Dirk's shoulder with an agile bound. The cat's tail laid itself across the back of Dirk's neck. Dirk continued to look down at the enemy he killed. He slowly revealed a smile. Sending people weaker than me to find me. Though, they were still rank four. Despite not having advanced much, you've become far stronger. You can kill those above you in rank, at the very least. When stealthed. Stealth is a skill that you've been working on for many months. You've hidden from Azura with it, and now, it allows you to silently kill those around your power level. These are the fruits of your struggle. Dirk was silent as Spite spoke. It had gotten smarter over time, and it encouraged Dirk when he accomplished things like this. At some point though, Dirk's head raised. He looked off into the distance where he could sense faint fire mana fluctuations. More enemies. Escaping without killing is the safest route away from here. That's true. Dirk nodded softly. Still, he soon found himself dashing over. Spite blinked its eyes from his shoulder. I guess it's a predator's nature to hunt. It mumbled as they appeared near a group of five. It saw Dirk gaze at the five enemies with ruthless acuity. Spite jumped off his shoulder. As it crawled off to watch the surroundings, it left some words. Happy hunting. Chapter 95, Trail Dirk knew that spending his time killing people would increase the risk of getting caught. Maybe he would find an enemy he couldn't fight and get captured. Maybe Azura was still scouting the place for him and would see the bodies he left, finding his trail. But when Dirk saw those search parties and remembered the past two and a half years, he felt a measurable bloodlust cloud his mind. He had fought through so much pain to get to this point. Now that he could look beyond just escaping that hell, he found himself making a vow for the future. I'm going to kill all of them. I will dismantle everything Azura has worked for. I'll do everything in my power to get in his way. I'll get stronger, so strong that I can one day bring Azura to his knees. I'll cut his head off as everything crumbles around him. Killing these people is just the start. He thought to himself as he created metal arrows and shot them toward an enemy. The enemy was impaled, his heart and head pierced. He collapsed instantly. This enemy, like many others before him, had died while staring at Spite. Spite would gaze at them with its golden eyes, 
and that was a great distraction for Dirk to use. Spite jumped on Dirk's shoulder when he finished. On the horizon, the sun began to rise. It had been seventy hours since Dirk left. He had been awake for all seventy. And during that single night, Dirk had killed thirty-two of Azura's men. Seeing light stream into the dark jungle, Dirk took a deep breath. Then, he started running. It was a moderate but fast pace. His mana sense detected all the leaves and foliage as he ran, and although he tripped a few times, he quickly got used to seeing the various roots and obstacles on the ground. Like that, he focused on covering ground. Dirk had only gone ten more miles during the night, putting him twenty miles away from the mountain. Now, he needed to increase that distance several times over. So he did. He ran until he reached the fifty-mile mark. And then he kept running. He kept running until he encountered a monster. Dirk stopped when he spotted a large bear-like creature with razor-sharp claws and long teeth. It looked like a bear, but on steroids with obvious muscles under its fur. It was also seven feet tall on all fours. Dirk was baffled by the size of the animal. He was also surprised when the animal instantly spotted him. When it did, it attacked. Roar! It bellowed as it ran toward Dirk. At the same time, Dirk saw the earth man around him go crazy, creating walls that boxed him in and spikes that threatened to impale him. Dodge! Shing! Dirk was one step ahead of Spite as he shifted his body and swung out his knife. He dodged one spike and broke another. Only, when he broke the spike, he felt his hand tremble. The spike was incredibly hard, obviously backed by powerful mana. Tier 5? Ridiculous. Dirk gawked at the strength of the magic. While that one spike didn't have tier 5 power behind it, only tier 4, it was also only a casual strike from the bear. Dirk knew that there was much more where that came from. So as the bear threatened to turn him into a puddle of gore, Dirk quickly made a decision. Spite made it at the same time. Run! Whoosh! Dirk kicked off the ground, backing away from the bear. Then, he ran toward one of the thick walls. He didn't even try to break through it, instead jumping up it. Equipping two knives in his hands, Dirk stabbed into the wall, proceeding to climb it with the knives. He quickly got to the top, but that's when a spike shot toward him. Dirk shifted his body on instinct, but the spike still sliced open his side. Dirk disregarded the injury as he jumped off the wall. Then, he ran with all his might. The bear crashed through its own wall and chased him. For its large body, it was shockingly fast, keeping up with Dirk and continually casting spikes to stop him. Dirk hastily dodged spikes that appeared in his way. Some of them cut him, while he fully dodged others. For most of them, it was a close call. The spikes were created and shot out too fast. Not only that, at some point, the ground began to shift under him, throwing off his balance. Dirk was barely able to escape this by using the trees all around as anchors. But this slowed him down, and the bear caught up more. Like that, Dirk was close to becoming food for the bear. It got closer and closer while casting complex magic back to back. Dirk used his own magic where he could, but it was still a challenge to keep distance. Then, just as Dirk got dangerously close to the bear, he spotted something. It was another animal, a massive alligator that ate some prey next to a river. Dirk ran toward the alligator that quickly noticed him and the bear. Narrowing its eyes, the alligator let out a growl before shooting toward Dirk. Now, he was being attacked from both sides. Dirk didn't panic though. Right when he was about to be eaten two ways, Dirk's body suddenly disappeared in a black cloud. The two monsters collided, and then started to attack each other. Ten feet away, the cloud that shifted with speeds unattainable by running revealed Dirk's body. He sprinted off after his spell wore off. Good application of void walking. Spite complimented him as he took deep breaths. That had been the watered-down void walking spell. Dirk couldn't use that often with his limited supply of dark mana. Still, it had saved his life. Dirk continued to run as the two monsters roared in the distance. What the hell is with these animals? 
Azura told you that this is one of the most hostile environments within the Horizon Empire's territories. Turns out he wasn't lying. Guess so. Dirk shook his head. He really didn't want to encounter more like that. Unfortunately, he wasn't such lucky man. After another while of running, Dirk encountered a dark cloud within the jungle. This dark cloud buzzed ominously, and when he stressed his senses, Dirk was able to see bugs. They were mosquitoes. But not normal mosquitoes. These bugs were the size of a palm, and their needle noses were as long as a finger. Dirk shivered when he saw the thick cloud of them. There were hundreds. And they noticed him, too. Run. Spite rapidly made the best call, and Dirk instantly turned. He sprinted at full speed, faster than when he was running away from the steroid bear. Shit. He cursed though as the bugs rapidly caught up to him. They used wind magic to zip through the air. Dirk was stabbed by one, and he felt a horrible numbing sensation from the wound. He slapped the bug, causing it to explode on his arm. Fire! Spite yelled. The next moment, a magic circle appeared on Dirk's hand. Fireballs were created, and he launched them toward the dark cloud. Boom! The fireballs exploded, engulfing the swarm in flames. However, many of the mosquitoes used wind magic to keep the flames away, mitigating damage. They continued. So Dirk kept throwing out fire like he was a human flamethrower. Gradually, the swarm died down as he stressed his mana breathing. But it wasn't enough. Dirk's head throbbed as he threw out one last magic. The swarm was reduced to only 30 mosquitoes, but Dirk was certain that getting bit by that many would kill him. But he was tired. His fatigue built over 70 hours and wounds from the steroid bear's spikes were catching up to him. Still, he ignored the pain as he activated his anima, preparing to take them on personally. It was then though that he heard an odd sound. Splat! Dirk saw a red streak fly through the air, taking one of the mosquitoes with it. Then, there were twenty-nine more red streaks, and all the bugs disappeared from the air. Rib bit. Dirk heard the deep sound of a frog. Turning, he really did see frogs. He saw a lot of frogs. Growl. An army of frogs. One frog stood in front of a hundred others. This one frog was nearly five feet tall, and all the other frogs were a foot or two in height. Dirk was no longer surprised as the leader let out low growling noises. I'm gonna die in a jungle. We've gone from the predators to the prey. Still, a gazelle can outrun a lion. Run, gazelle. Roar. Just as Spite spoke, the frog let out an uncharacteristic roar. Dirk turned and ran once more with all his might. The prey worked hard to keep its feeble life. Eighty hours, impressive. Ugh. Shut up. Dirk grunted as he slumped against a branch. He was currently up in a tree, and blood streamed down his body from various wounds. He had run for another ten straight hours, but it hadn't been a casual jog. One after another, Dirk encountered dozens of monsters and freakish animals. A bird with a serrated beak, a pack of squirrels that threw acorns like bullets, snakes that whipped you with their razor-sharp tails. At some point, Dirk even found hostile plants. He had almost gotten restrained by some vines with thorns while stopping to rest for a moment. He had also been poisoned by a plant that spit a corrosive cloud of vapor at him. Truly, this jungle had to be one of the most naturally hostile places in this world. If Dirk didn't complete his blood destruction that gave him vastly increased vitality and energy regeneration, he wouldn't have come so far. There was one other thing though that had saved his life a few times. Distributing potion. Spite spoke as Dirk felt a soothing liquid stream through parts of his body. Any poison or dangerous wounds were treated with the minimum amount of potion. Dirk had been injected with this potion for years, so he naturally had some stocked up. But this jungle was forcing him to use a lot of it. Already he's used a quarter of his supply, and that was only for lethal wounds. He left anything that would naturally heal. Dirk seriously would have died without the potion. But in exchange, he managed to reach the 250 mile mark. 
Dirk's anima allowed him to reach high speeds even within the jungle and constantly maintain it, even for a dozen hours at a time. But it wasn't enough. He was still in this damn jungle, and he didn't know the way out. I would say look at the stars to track our position, but well. Very funny. Dirk snorted a bit. He had in fact thought of the same thing, but he quickly remembered that he couldn't sense anything beyond 30 meters around him. And he also had to sense it through mana. It was truly tragic. It was at that point though that Spite found itself thinking. We see things through mana. We see solid objects with earth mana, heat sources with fire mana, and biological nervous systems with lightning mana. So would we use dark mana to see dark things? See the dark? Yes? Spite was unsure of itself, but Dirk's interest was piqued. The dark element was the only one of his attributes he didn't use to sense things. Unfortunately, Dirk didn't exactly have the mind right now to do experiments. He eventually shook his head. We can think about that later. For now, I need to get at least a minute of sleep. Of course. I'll keep watch. Thanks. With a nod, Dirk rested his head against a branch. It only took three seconds for him to fall asleep. He had been awake for over 80 hours and running for 20. Sleep was overdue. Spite diligently watched the surroundings in its cat form, making sure nothing would sneak up on them. What do you mean, you didn't find him? In a city on the outskirts of the Empire, Cecilia was standing in a small reception hall within a mansion. Her eyes were haggard, but sharp. But she was also reserved. She faced a single man, and in front of him, she didn't dare speak harshly. This man stood seven feet tall, towering over Cecilia with a large body sculpted with muscles that his clothes did nothing to hide. He wore glorious robes that fluctuated with intense power, his head covered in blazing golden hair that looked both wild yet tamed, and a single crest that carried the weight of absolute authority. Yet, even without the crest, this man commanded valiance and respect beyond all others. His sharp face and flowing hair made him look like the world's hero. Emperor Horizon, the ruler of the Horizon Empire about six months after Dirk was taken, the Emperor himself personally stepped out. Cecilia had long since joined a military intelligence force to track down Azura and his whereabouts, dismantling the organization that was the fallen Azuras in the process. And then, when the Emperor pledged his assistance to the cause, Cecilia's progress skyrocketed. Cecilia didn't care about why the Emperor had finally left his seclusion and stepped out or why he personally worked with her to track down Azura. She knew in the back of her head that there was something much bigger here at play, but she only cared about finding her son. She welcomed anyone that helped, including the Emperor. And while it had taken another six months, they had finally tracked down Azura. They found that mountain that Dirk was held in and confirmed that Azura was there. It was actually Dirk's escape attempt that tipped them off to the location. Cecilia had been stunned by the fact that her son had even attempted to escape, let alone had a small success. Either way, Cecilia immediately wanted to charge in. In fact, she was desperate to. It had already been a year since he was taken, and she didn't know if he had been able to hold out. But the Emperor didn't let her go. He forced her to wait, and instead of a frontal assault, he arranged for a silent infiltration. Azura wasn't the only one who trained assassins. The Empire had its own division of spies and infiltrators. So they mobilized some and succeeded in getting two of them grabbed and taken by Azura's men. Like that, they waited another year while maintaining contact with the two spies. The Emperor personally guided them as only he could maintain constant contact without alerting Azura through a special magic. Like that, they learned Dirk's situation. They learned about the whipping, his blindness, his escape attempts, the bombs, and more. It was finally when the Emperor was ready that he had those two give Dirk a message. Luckily, Dirk was able to pick up on it, and when Dirk came back to the two with his escape plan, they knew it had been a success. Like that, they waited for Dirk to move, and he didn't disappoint. The three escaped, and Azura didn't find them. After another few days, the Emperor came back. He had his two infiltrators with him, but not Dirk. 
This led them to now, when Cecilia was questioning the emperor. Despite her restrained rage, he looked at her with a slightly sorry gaze before speaking in a deep tone. Your son. I think he did too well trying to hide. After I confronted Azura, I did some light searching so as to not alert the man. But I didn't find him. I searched around the fifty-mile mark for an entire day, but came up with nothing. He just, vanished. And your people? They released some signals after a while. Both of them were close to dying when I found them. The monsters in that jungle are vicious. Cecilia was silent. The emperor smiled as she started to worry though. But don't worry. We picked up on something else. What? It was around seventy hours after the escape, but some of our men sent to intercept Azura's men encountered bodies. We counted thirty, intact corpses as well as a few others that may have been eaten by animals. All of them were killed by metal arrows to the head and hearts, knives to the lungs, sliced tendons and arteries, severed necks. The handiwork of an assassin. It was impressive, seeing the images. The emperor tossed a crystal shard to Cecilia when he said that. She grabbed it, and data was streamed into her mind. She saw myriads of images, including some eerie ones of corpses nailed to trees. The emperor let out a breath. We know his direction, but not his location. For now, he's heading toward a city. I suggest you take a small group of men and wait there, maybe scout out the path he would take. In the meantime, we must continue our work with dismantling that training ground. They've put up a heavy resistance, but I plan on going personally in a couple of hours to take control of the situation. I will heed your advice. As you see fit. I'm sorry I couldn't find your son, Lady Strider. Or, perhaps maybe that's a compliment to his abilities. The Emperor walked out of the hall as he left those words. Cecilia half nodded to him. Then, she left with a blur. She rushed to follow the only trail she had. Chapter 96, Jungle of Death Dirk was able to sleep for six hours, which was an amount of time he was more than satisfied with. When he woke, he continued running in a single direction. Dirk made sure he didn't turn or run in zigzags so as to get out of the jungle as fast as possible. Because the longer he stayed in the jungle, the higher the chances of him being killed were. Shing! Dirk swung his knife, slicing a snake in half. While he ran, it had suddenly jumped off a tree, shooting at him like a bullet. It had been a surprise attack, but Dirk's instincts and reflexes allowed him to move before he even thought about moving. Dirk encountered dozens and hundreds of monsters of all types. Many of them were camouflaged, and even with Dirk's heightened mana sense, he had a hard time seeing them. But under such high stress where he was forced to spot his enemies or be killed, Dirk's senses sharpened to their utmost degree. Dirk had already done experiments with the limits of his mana sense. His mana sense extended out in a 30-meter radius, giving him a clear and sharp view of anything within that radius. Beyond that, Dirk was only able to faintly make out images, and this faint sense dropped off for around 100 meters before fading into nothing. That meant that beyond 100 meters, Dirk was absolutely blind. But while his mana sense may not have been as nice as vision, he was actually able to discover more than if he had his vision. The animals that used stealth in this jungle usually covered themselves up with dense mana. Dirk sometimes couldn't sense heat from an animal, but he could sense the thick earth mana that comprised their strong bodies. There were all these little clues that Dirk picked up on, and he learned to use his mana sense more than before. And his mana sense was actually more responsive than vision. Vision had a delay when the brain processed the light that came into the eyes. But mana sense, as far as Dirk knew, came from the soul or the like. That meant that Dirk sensed things in real time. The instant something happened, the changes were sensed. It gave him much greater reaction speeds, even though he still had to take the time to move his body. Thankfully, his reflexes were also fantastic. It was no exaggeration to say that Dirk's life, while being preserved by his stored potion, was saved many times over by his mana sense. He avoided instant death situations that were all too plentiful in this jungle. But Dirk didn't stop at just sharpening his mana sense. After another day, 
Dirk began developing his dark mana sense. Spite had spoken of using dark mana to see dark things. Dirk had followed that logic and began looking through the dark mana around him. While he couldn't control the dark mana due to Eldritch Primordial, he could still sense it. And Dirk was shocked to find out that he could indeed see dark things. Specifically, he saw darkness. Shadows were everywhere, and they were created by something blocking light. Different materials also absorbed light in different ways, creating colors and varying levels of brightness. There was light, and then lack of light. Dirk tuned into this lack of light. It was like he could see things in black and white. It took Dirk a while, but he was able to see things in different shades depending on how much light there was. Regardless if something was lit up with a flashlight, there was still dark mana. Dirk picked up on this dark mana, and depending on the amount, he could form images in his mind. Like that, Dirk began to see things from the perspective of light and no light. Of course, it was still mana, but it made it seem more like normal vision. And most importantly, Dirk was able to pick up on sources of light. By detecting areas of little to no dark mana, he could infer that it was a source of a large amount of light. And with contextual information, he figured out what the source of light was. Maybe it was the sun being reflected off of a small puddle, or a shiny plant that was actually a deadly enemy waiting to eat Dirk alive. Dirk was able to sense a whole new level of detail. The only thing missing was color. Of course, even this black and white sense had to be developed. Dirk was actually thrown off by it when he tried to connect the things he was seeing through dark mana with the objects he saw through earth or fire mana. But Dirk was eager to regain what could be thought of as an alternative to vision, so he worked on it with gusto. Like that, he spent another two days running and dodging death in the jungle. Across each day, Dirk used about a quarter of his potion supply. At the end of the second day, he settled down during the night. Damn. I can't keep going like this. Dirk frowned as he grabbed a nearby vine. It was tough, almost like thick wire. He wrapped the vine around his forearm. He began using various items he found in the jungle to his advantage. The vines were one of these items. Because they were tough, he began wrapping them around his forearms and calves, using them as a kind of armor. This saved him from snakes that wanted to bite or slash him and hostile plants that went after his legs. Although cuts and slices weren't deadly, they were definitely annoying. Dirk didn't need to keep building up wounds. Still, his body was being continuously worn down, and he didn't have much potion left. He didn't know how long this jungle would go on for, so he needed something that gave him more longevity. He thought for a second as Spite jumped onto his lap. The two looked at each other. Gun. Roger. Spite responded before disappearing. The next moment, a black and gold pistol appeared in Dirk's hand. Dirk hadn't yet used this pistol. Because he was constantly moving and conserving energy, he needed reconnaissance more than firepower. Spite helped him more in its cat form than pistol form as it could run ahead and preemptively spot enemies. It could even act as bait bringing hidden enemies out of their holes. This had saved Dirk an amazing amount of trouble. But things were about to change. Dirk decided that he needed to be more aggressive. Rather than hide from the enemies, he needed to take the fight to them. While he didn't think he could kill everything in this jungle, he could at least keep them from continuously hurting him. Dirk raised the pistol. He pushed his mana into it, and the golden circuits glowed. Runes seemed to be engraved on the body of the pistol above the circuits as they fluctuated with fiery power. Then, he pulled the trigger. From the barrel shot out a fireball that exploded on a distant tree. The body dimmed rapidly afterward, ready for another use. Dirk was impressed. Although he had been slow with the activation, he could intuitively understand how the pistol worked. He pulled the trigger three times, and within a mere second, Three fireballs shot out in succession. They all exploded on the same tree, and that tree quickly split in half under the magic, collapsing with a thud. Very nice. Dirk smiled brightly. It was a magic tool. A spellcaster. Dirk felt that it was many times easier to cast spells when using this pistol than normal. 
Spite chimed in. Your mind controls mana and creates runes, and usually, you need to form the runes and create a magic circuit in order to form a complete and stable spell. But when using your stigma, you bypass the need to make a circuit. The pistol is the circuit, and the spell creation process is expedited to bring about the manifestation quicker. This vastly increases speed and efficiency, consuming less mana and energy. At least, that's my understanding. Not only that, because the stigma is formed from your soul, you are capable of determining the amount of energy you infuse on the fly, as if selecting a value. However, I have found two limitations to the pistol. What limitations? The amount of energy you can infuse. In any single shot, you cannot infuse more than a certain amount of energy, an amount I surmise is around 10% of your entire energy pool. Also, the speed at which you can fire depends on your proficiency in forming the runes of the spell. You may not need to make a stable magic circle, but you still need to know and form the runes as if silent casting. Hmm. Dirk tilted his head as he observed the pistol more. Eventually, he shrugged. That's fine. I'm actually more concerned with the spells that are being fired off. This thing is like a magic wand, but its purpose is to fire at ranged targets. To take full advantage of that, I need fast projectiles that pack a punch, like bullets. There are no known spells of such types, only perhaps a single fire spell that resembles a bullet when compressed enough. So we'll have to make our own. Understood. There is one more thing you should know about the pistol though. Hmm. Suddenly, Dirk heard a click from the pistol. He moved his hand, and a magazine dropped from the grip. This magazine is capable of storing spells. Again, you cannot infuse more than 10% of your power into any one spell, but you can store up to 8 spells within and fire them without expenditure. This will be helpful for when you run low on energy. Yes, it will be. Dirk was happily surprised as he played with the magazine. There were eight capsules within the magazine resembling cartridges. Thinking, Dirk took out one of the cartridges and cast a spell on it. It was a simple fireball spell. When it was cast, the cartridge consumed the spell, and a fiery bullet was formed. He put the bullet back into the magazine, loading it into the gun as he racked the slide. Bang! Ching! After firing the gun, Dirk saw the cartridge eject. It flew a few feet to the side and disappeared, automatically returning to the bottom of the magazine. At the same time, the same fireball as previously flew out and hit another tree. Very nice. Dirk smiled even wider. The next moment though, he looked back at the body of the gun. On the side of it in the middle of the body, the golden circuits seemed to come together at a single point and at this point was an empty cavity a bit bigger than a marble. Dirk tilted his head. What's this cavity? I'm not entirely sure about its function, only that it connects to the entire circuit system through the gun, almost like a power nexus. So could I put something in there? Like a mana crystal? You would need to do so to find out. All right. If I get my hands on one, then I'll try. Until then, let's load these bullets. That night, Dirk took some time to load his gun. He only loaded five bullets before being exhausted of all his energy, but those were five potential lifesavers. He was more than happy, and fell asleep content. The next day, Dirk took the fight to the jungle. Ching! His pistol constantly released fireballs and arrows at various enemies that appeared in front of him. It consumed more energy, and focusing on the enemies for any amount of time slowed him down but he was wounded much less, and by extension, had to use less of his life-saving potion. More than that though, Dirk seemed to have too much fun with his new toy. Ching! He smiled as he fired a small metal arrow at a monkey. It had swung around and harassed him for a while, throwing rocks faster than a professional baseball pitcher. But this arrow was perfectly placed, and the monkey was nailed to a branch. It screamed only for a moment before another arrow ended its life. Although Dirk didn't have bullets, he could still cast similar magic. He found himself using arrows despite their slow projectile speed. And with his accuracy, there was very little he couldn't hit with absolute precision. 
Of course, some animals were just too fast. Like a group of hummingbirds that Dirk had to escape from. They zipped around with the wind, making it impossible for him to hit them with his slow arrows. In the end, Dirk had to use three of his prepared spells, releasing three huge fireballs that burned most of them, as well as the surrounding forest, to a crisp. And so, Dirk ended his thrilling day when night fell. He dug himself a hole underneath a tree and used it as his tent. He frowned as he reflected on the battles he fought. Spite sat on his lap in its cat form. I need to be able to see farther. This had been a problem for a while now. Dirk could only see clearly for thirty meters around him. After that, it was a blur that only got worse for one hundred meters. Realistically, Dirk could only make out objects up to fifty meters away. The rest was too blurry to make absolute judgments. At first, Dirk had thought that his dark mana sense could fix that. Light came from everywhere, so no matter how far, he should be able to pick up on different shades of light, producing black and white vision. But that proved to be much more difficult to do than he initially thought. He still often found his dark mana sense to show different things from his other senses. He couldn't reliably trust it. So he needed something else. Something that could give him at least a glance at something further away than 50 meters. And Spite had a good idea. Sonar. She spoke a concept only known to him who came from Earth. Sonar creates pulses of sound that spread out and return when they hit something. You can do that with mana. It won't be constant, but you should be able to catch glimpses of objects at a distance. Interesting. How would I do that? No idea. Spite quickly gave up. Although it was much more logical and interactive than the previous AI, it wasn't all knowing. Most of what it said were merely facts that both of them already knew. Throwing out this idea was merely taking inspiration from Dirk's thoughts and memories. So Dirk got to thinking. Pulses of mana? No, that would be too obvious, wouldn't it? It would also consume a lot of mana. What about pulses of energy? Instead of sending out mana, I can just disrupt the mana already there by shaking it with energy. That would make the mana visible, right? Would it? How are you able to see mana in the first place? What causes it to be visible? That's a fantastic question. Let me know when you find the answer to it. Spite drooped its ears at the sarcasm, causing Dirk to chuckle and pet it. Dirk started petting Spite a lot more since it had such soft and warm fur. It was also the only physical interaction he had with anything that didn't involve killing right now. He just enjoyed it. Anyway, let's try it out tomorrow. Dirk ended the night with that. In the next morning, he was fighting for his life once more. Ching! Ugh! Dirk frowned at the headache that came over him. More so though at the bite wound on his leg. He could feel paralyzing poison stream through his blood vessels. After his nanites blocked off the vessels though, potion was injected, getting rid of the poison and healing Dirk. You have enough potion for two more lethal injuries. Dirk frowned even more at Spite's words. After a bit he just sighed. Do I need to slow my pace? Dirk pondered as he grabbed a vine, wrapping it around his bloody arm. After tying it, he sat down on a rock, squashing a couple large bugs that tried to crawl up his foot. The gun in his hand transformed back into a cat. Spite looked at him with its golden eyes. The longer you remain in the jungle, the more enemies you face. But I run into enemies too often if I move fast. Well it is a jungle. Problem is my stealth doesn't help as much as it should. That's because you're not remaining absolutely still and cutting off your senses. So do I slow down? The longer you remain in the Jew dash. I get it. Dirk interrupted Spite's repetitive words with a sigh. There was no good way to avoid enemies and injury in this place. Even when Dirk did use stealth, hawk-like enemies would always spot him one way or another. It seems like you're getting closer to the edge though. Spite spoke those words of confidence. After a while, Dirk noticed the stronger enemies become scarcer. There were fewer steroid bears, fewer massive alligators, fewer killer monkeys, and fewer frog armies. This at least meant that he was getting away from the center. 
I really hope things get easier soon. If I get into a bad situation without the potion, I could lose my life. We can only use everything at our disposal. Luckily you've had some success with your new sonar technique. That alerted us of several unfavorable situations. Hmm. Dirk nodded. For the past day, he had worked on and succeeded in creating an elemental pulse technique. The technique actually worked by employing Dirk's mana resonance skill. Using it, he resonated the mana in a wave, and any mana caught in this wave would resonate with the material it was inside or around. This gave Dirk not only a clear view of things far away, but gave him the sharpest image of material he had ever seen since developing his mana sense. And he could do it directionally too. Dirk had learned to send out a pulse toward his front, and by concentrating that power, he was able to get a detailed image of everything in a 200-meter cone. He used that periodically to avoid monsters. And best of all, it only slightly alerted the monsters. Their heads would raise and they would look around, clearly having felt something. But they wouldn't know from where. This allowed Dirk to retain a bit of stealth. It was incredibly useful, and that was only the crude prototype. There was still a lot of refining to do. I really have a lot of spells to work on. Nothing like practical tests to make them better. Practical tests are usually better when my life isn't at stake. Stress makes you sharper. That's true. Dirk smirked as he ruffled the cat's hair. After that, he called it a night. He hoped there wasn't much farther to go, or at the very least, that there weren't any difficult enemies in front of him. Chapter 97 City Dirk ran for another two days. The first day got a bit easier. Dirk actually didn't use up the rest of his potion. Thanks to his elemental sonar, his dark mana vision, his improving stealth, his pistol stigma, and his sharpening reflexes, he was able to avoid more death and injury. Not only that, but he remembered another ability he had gained upon completing blood destruction. He could use aura, a power that gave his fists vast destructive power. Dirk didn't find too much use for this though. Most of the strong monsters he found were too tough to be wounded by his weak attacks or too dangerous to even approach. He was mostly defending, and any attacks he did send out were mostly ways to distract and divert, allowing him to escape. Dirk couldn't get into head-on fights and let his wounds build up, even though he had decided to play more aggressive. But it was still a tool that he could utilize when the situation called for it. It allowed Dirk to break through many barriers and kill bugs using something other than fire. He liked using it on mosquitoes, especially. It was another tool that, although not used often, gave him yet another edge. And with his accumulating techniques and skills, Dirk found himself finding a way out of the jungle of death. The first thing he started to notice was the lack of obscenely strong monsters, like the steroid bear. In fact, he didn't see any the entire second day. The second thing he noticed was the change in foliage. Gone were all the poison-spewing and man-eating plants. Dirk began to see berry bushes and fruit trees. There was thinner grass, fewer vines, shorter trees, not as much mud, clearer water, and all-around brighter scenery. In these places, Dirk found animals like wolves, deer, small birds, smaller bears, much smaller bugs, and no frog armies. He saw many enemies, but now, all of them were enemies he could safely fight. In reasonable amounts, of course. At one point, Dirk got swarmed by a pack of sixty wolves in the middle of the night. That had been a rude wake-up call. But he got out of it. Even sixty wolves were reasonable compared to a steroid bear. Dirk could actually wound and kill them. Like that, he found himself nearing signs of civilization at the end of the second day. It was a good thing too because he had just gone through the rest of his potion. Like that, he was brought to the third day. On this day, Dirk disregarded any and all enemies as he rushed forward, following the signs of civilization. And by noon, he emerged. The frontier city of Kalaba. Due to it being on the edges of what Dirk called the jungle of death, it was a mix between a city and a stronghold. It didn't look super appealing unless one liked the fortress aesthetic. Nonetheless, it was incredibly popular and had a booming economy. There were four reasons for this. 
the first was actually due to the jungle of death right beside it. Because of the plentiful source of monsters and animals right next door, the city had a large mercenary and hunter presence that lived off of killing and gathering biological resources. The meat industry in this city was booming. The second was the fact of a mine being near this city. Thus, there were many miners that provided a steady source of income and resources. The material processing industry was also booming. The third reason was due to a dungeon being inside of the city. And not just any dungeon, but a major dungeon that was a step above what Dirk had fought in. This attracted a small but powerful dungeon diver population. And the more powerful the fighter, the richer they were. Heaps of wealth were moved whenever they made transactions. Finally, one of the biggest reasons for this city's prosperity was its location. This city was located eastern border of the Horizon Empire. And next to the Horizon Empire was the Dwarven Haven. If one went above the jungle of death and traced its outskirts, they would eventually find themselves entering Dwarven territory. The Dwarven Haven and Horizon Empire traded often, both diplomatically and commercially. In fact, the two empires had a fantastic standing with each other due to all this trade. It boosted both their economies. And a large amount of this trade funneled right through the frontier city of Kalaba. This city seemed to have everything. The only downside was the fact that this city needed to maintain a standing army and be able to defend against tides of monsters from the jungle of death. Either way, this city was massive and rich. So when it was approached by a boy covered in blood, mud, and vines, it naturally raised its alert. Dirk exited the jungle and entered a wide open clearing where there were no trees or plants, only grass. And in the distance he spotted the city of Kalaba. It had walls that were fifty meters tall and extended left and right for nearly five miles. Buildings even taller than the walls towered from within the strong defenses. They got gradually taller until they reached the center where there was a 500-meter-tall palace. The palace actually had objects floating in and out of it, though Dirk couldn't make out what they were. In fact, the only reason Dirk was able to see any of this magnificent view was due to his dark mana vision that created black and white images based on light. It was generally hit or miss with the accuracy, but Dirk got the gist. This city is huge. I'm surprised steroid bears haven't destroyed it yet. Dirk said that as he walked toward the huge walls. There were about 500 meters of grassland between the edge of the forest and the walls, so Dirk stuck out as he approached. After getting closer and letting out some elemental pulses, Dirk was able to find the gates to the city. The gates were naturally huge, and there was a long line of wagons and people flowing in. But Dirk didn't plan to enter the normal way. He didn't forget that Azura was probably looking for him, so he couldn't attract attention. Thus, his brain warmed up a little as he thought of a way in. Ah, damn. The hell is that smell? Which one of you are letting your cheeks puff? Not me boss. It was definitely Jeremy. Ha. Ah. Mine don't smell this nice. A dwarf waved his hand as an odor suddenly washed over his group. They were rolling in a wagon up to the gates, eventually getting stopped by the guards. ID check please. Right here. The head dwarf pulled out a card when requested. The guard had an orb in his hand, and he inserted the card into the orb. When it glowed green, he took it out and handed it back. All good. Are you transporting any goods that are on the list of illegal contraband? As if I would tell you. Sure, sure. The guard just let out a breath at the dwarf's laugh. At the same time, a few other guards did shallow checks on the caravan before giving a thumbs up. All good. Head in. Of course. Like that, the caravan rolled forward. Suddenly though, there was an alarm as some barriers suddenly raised in front of the wagon. Ha. Huh. Sir. There are suspicious magic fluctuations in the wagon. Dark type. Shing! A few guards suddenly drew their swords at that moment. The head guard also narrowed his eyes at the dwarf, who hastily waved. I didn't do anything. I'm not even a mage. Step down. The dwarf was pulled off the wagon and restrained, as were all the other dwarves. Then, 
guards flooded into the wagons, checking every nook and cranny. Suddenly though, as one of the guards bent down to look under the wagon, he was kicked away. Boom! The guard flew away from the wagon and into a wall, leaving behind cracks. Then, a body shot out from under the wagon. The head guard shouted. Seize that man. Get him. The surroundings guards all rushed out as the alarms blared. Dirk, who was the culprit, gritted his teeth. I hid from Azura with this stealth. Why can't it get past a security checkpoint? Dirk grumbled as he dashed to the side. There was a doorway inside the walls where the guards would occasionally rest, so he made his way through there, dodging all the resting guards and shooting out into the city. He quickly bounded with his full strength onto the roof of a building. A few guards followed, chasing him down with their full strength. Unfortunately, Dirk was someone who could keep his life in the presence of a steroid bear. After jumping across a couple rooftops, he slipped between buildings, through alleyways, through open windows, and weaved through crowds of people. The guards couldn't keep up with his agility, and before long, he disappeared. Where'd he go? I don't know. Well, look harder. No, you look harder. The guards started bickering before searching around the place. Dirk, on the other hand, had slipped into a shop. It was a nice little fruit store, and when Dirk turned around, he saw a young woman no older than fourteen years old manning the front desk. She looked at Dirk with a terrified gaze. His body that was covered in mud and blood. The open, unhealed wounds. The dark vines tied around his arms and legs. His eyes that had horrible black cracks all over them. His six-foot-tall body. The intimidating chiseled muscles. This little girl couldn't help but shiver. Thinking, Dirk put his finger over his lips to tell her to be quiet. Then, he walked over to a shelf, grabbing a fruit and eating it. Oh my god. His head rolled back a little as he tasted the sweet juices. For over two years he had eaten slop. He hadn't tasted anything else other than blood when it pooled in his mouth. This was the first real stimulation of his taste buds in a long time. You didn't actually eat anything in the jungle either. The potion made me not hungry. Dirk spoke simply as he ate one fruit and grabbed another. As he said, the potion basically removed the need for food. Even in the mountain there were times when he wouldn't eat for days or weeks simply because Della kept whipping him during his free time. He had lived off the potion for a long time. After eating two fruits though, Dirk eventually reined himself in. He looked at the girl, who looked back at him with silent fear and a bit of anger. He was taking their food, after all. Feeling sorry, Dirk suddenly looked at his arm. On both forearms, two knives were sheathed and the vines tied around them. He unsheathed one of them and walked over to the girl. And no! Thud! The girl stumbled backward before hearing a heavy object land on the front desk. Looking up, she saw that Dirk placed the knife on the desk. I hope that's good enough for payment. The girl was silent as Dirk turned and walked out, taking one more fruit with him. Like that, he disappeared, and the girl stared at the large, crude knife on the table that was stained with blood and bigger than her leg. After leaving the shop, Dirk found a tall building and climbed to the top of it. He let out a long breath as he felt a breeze blow past his body. I need to blend in. After a while, he made his plans while taking another bite of his fruit. Dirk couldn't go walking around looking like a forest monster. He had to clean his body, get some clothes, and look normal. While he didn't have the money for clothes or a bath, he did have the skills to get those things anyway. I have yet to ever steal anything in this life. A first time for everything. Spite spoke as it appeared on Dirk's shoulder in its cat form. He chuckled and scratched its chin. Spite apparently liked it as its chin raised itself to be scratched better. Or maybe it was just playing the part of a cat. Anyway, let's go make myself pretty. Like that, Dirk jumped off the building and made his way around the city. It was a bright and sunny day, and for the first time in a while, Dirk's mood reflected that. After around four hours, Dirk had made himself presentable. First he found a bathhouse. It wasn't open during the middle of the day, 
but that only made it easier for Dirk to use its facilities without notice. He just had to avoid the owner who lived there. Using that, he cleaned his entire body, ridding himself of all the mud and blood. The bath that was the size of a pool had turned completely brown when he was done. After cleaning out his wounds and using soaps to make his skin nice and glossy, Dirk felt like a new man. He also thoroughly washed his only pair of shorts. At first, Dirk also wanted to dispose of the vines. But after they were soaked in the water, their skin peeled off, and Dirk saw what was inside. The vines actually had a wire-like core inside of them. Seeing that, Dirk went and skinned all the vines, exposing their cores. Then, he burned them to make their surfaces smooth and hard. With that, Dirk could keep them, not looking weird for having plants tied on his body. He only kept two of the vines though, one for each forearm. That way he could sheath his knife. As for the other arm, Dirk thought about throwing away the extra vine, but then he saw the large metal tattoo with a big number 8. This was the harbinger mark that Dirk was given, a permanent brand on his body that had never come off. Dirk decided that he didn't want to go waving it around, so he kept another vine to cover it. Like that, Dirk exited the bathhouse and found himself a nice clothing shop. It was at this point that Dirk could only apologize to the owner silently. He didn't want to give away his other knife, but he still needed clothes. So using his stealth, Dirk was able to hide in plain sight. He then found himself a new pair of shorts, shoes, socks, and a shirt. By the end, he looked like a sharp young man from a well-off family, if one looked past the few exposed wounds of course. After that, he tied the vines to his forearms and sheathed his knife. It wasn't odd for people to walk around with all kinds of weapons since this city had tons of dungeon divers and hunters, so he wouldn't look that out of place. The last problem though was his eyes. The black cracks that glowed with the power of the curse would definitely freak people out and cast suspicion. So Dirk tore a piece of cloth from a garment and tied it around his head, covering up the cursed cracks. With that, Dirk only looked mildly suspicious as he finally entered the streets of the city openly. Since guards were still patrolling the place, he just avoided them. Spite appeared on Dirk's shoulder as he walked around and sensed all the people and buildings. What are your plans now? Get back to the capital city. That's where the academy is and my parents are. I have to find out where I am though and how to get there. I also don't have money, though I could use my skills to maybe take up a guard position for a merchant. Dirk pondered. He was a stranger in a strange place. The only thing he knew was the name of this city, Kalaba, and that was only because he had sensed the large sign while crossing the city gates. Other than that, he had no idea where he was. So he wandered for a while, pondering what he would do. At that moment though, he suddenly felt a wave of dark mana. Dirk's senses shook a bit as he turned his head. On the rooftop of a large building, there was a woman dressed in black. Dirk saw her, and his eyebrows raised. Cecilia had long since arrived at the frontier city of Calaba. With her came a dozen subordinates. All of them were assigned jobs. Four of them were assigned to the four city gates into the city. The other eight people were told to scour the nearby jungle for people. They were to report all anomalies. It had been a few days since she did this, and with each passing hour, Cecilia got more and more anxious. That was, until one of her people came running back to her. Madam. Speak. The East Gate. There was a commotion when a suspicious person was caught by our special dark mana detectors. They ran off and escaped the pursuing guards not long after being spotted. What did they look like? Cecilia suddenly stood from her seat with seriousness. The man hastily spoke. Tall, completely covered in mud, and they smelled. He skillfully evaded capture, so we don't know where he is. I understand. Assigned patrols to look. I'm also going. Saying that, Cecilia almost ran out of the building, disappearing to the east gate. The man also ran out, going to give orders. After that, Cecilia scoured the city around the east gate for hours. She didn't find anybody at the edges near the walls, so she gradually made her way deeper in. She sent out waves of dark mana to skin everyone in the vicinity, 
constantly going from area to area. For a while, her hope that had spiked began to go down. But then, the fourth hour came. Cecilia let out a wave of dark mana from atop a roof. The people in the vicinity felt something faint, but generally disregarded the odd chill that washed over them. For a minute, Cecilia stood still. She processed the information she received, simultaneously looking around at everybody. But then, she was interrupted. She turned as a young man jumped onto her same roof. She froze. The young man looked at her. To Cecilia, he might as well be a stranger. He didn't look like her son, that little thirteen-year-old boy. But she could feel it. Perhaps it was her motherly instinct, or the sharp jawline. But she immediately knew. Dirk? She barely spoke, her voice already cracking under emotion. Dirk smiled back at his mother, someone who he had longed to see for a really long time. Hi mom. Chapter 98 Withdrawal Slash Adapt Cecilia couldn't seem to move. She felt like she wanted to dive to her son, embracing him right then and there. But then she remembered what had happened. Dirk had spent two and a half years at Azura's Mountain. She had already heard of the hell he had gone through. Getting whipped every single day, his tolerance rising so much that they used the level 10 whip on him. He was constantly tormented, Azura constantly trying to break him. Azura planted hate in people's minds, using that to control them. She knew that more than anyone. She had heard the report from the two infiltrators. She knew that Dirk resisted Azura, that he resisted the constant torture. But she didn't know Dirk's state of mind. Did he hate her? Did he resent her for not being able to do anything for two and a half years? Had Azura twisted him into some sort of monster? Just because he fought Azura didn't mean he was still on her side. She didn't know. For all she knew, he would attack and try to kill her as soon as he saw her. Or he would just spit at her feet and walk away, never wishing to see her again. She knew the hate Azura could fill people with. And she feared the worst. She feared that she lost her baby, the stoic child that liked her hugs but never admitted it. But she saw his smile. She saw how much he had grown, the wounds on his body, the bearing of a strong man. His voice was calm, deeper than it was before. Most of all, it was bright. It was happy. Dirk couldn't see his mother as he used to. He could only sense the dark mana that flowed through and around her body, along with other fine details provided by his earth mana and fire mana. But when he faced her, he also knew. This was his mother. He couldn't see her loving eyes anymore, but that didn't matter. He was happy. Hi mom. He spoke with a wide smile. He was now taller than his mother, but he still felt like a child in front of her. Though, he wasn't really sure what to say. So many things had happened, and he didn't really have the time to think about this moment. So he just said what came to mind. It's, nice to see you oof. My baby. Dirk was interrupted as Cecilia suddenly ran forward, almost crashing into him as she wrapped him up in a hug. He smiled as he quickly hugged her back. She cried. I'm so sorry. I'm... I'm so glad you're safe. I'm so sorry I couldn't find you sooner. Tears poured from Cecilia's eyes as she grabbed Dirk with a shocking amount of strength. Dirk activated a bit of anima to resist her powerful hug but smiled brightly nonetheless. It's okay, Mom. I'm back. I'm right here. My child is back. I'm never going to let you go again, Dirk. So does that mean I can't dungeon dive? He. Sniff. Cecilia couldn't help but chuckle. The two continued to hug, Cecilia's cries dying down. Do you hate your mother? She suddenly asked, causing Dirk to noticeably recoil. Cecilia felt his flinch and gritted her teeth a bit. She seemed to melt at the answer though. I love you, Mom. No amount of back scratching is going to change that. I love you too, my child. Your mother will always love you. Cecilia responded with a tighter hug when Dirk strengthened his own embrace. After another little while, they separated. 
Cecilia wiped her face and fixed her hair while Dirk shook out his now sore muscles. Ugh, I haven't cried like that in a while. You ruined my makeup, child. You wore makeup? I'll take that as a compliment. Cecilia huffed a bit with a bright smile. After making herself presentable, she turned back to Dirk and gave him a kiss on the forehead. Welcome back, sweetie. Thank you. What's wrong? Cecilia tilted her head when Dirk spoke unsurely. He was frowning. Then, Dirk suddenly bent over, falling to one knee. His mouth opened, and blood poured out like water. Dirk? Cough. My stomach. Dirk could barely speak before coughing up more blood. Then, he saw something in his mind. Alert. Extreme body decomposition detected. Genetic anomalies detected. Employing trait, adaptable genes. Dirk was a bit baffled by the notifications from Spite. Then, he fell over, his entire body weak. Dirk? I'll take you to a doctor, just hang on. Cecilia quickly picked up her child, dashing off across the buildings to the palace in the center of the city. As she did, she cast dark healing spells on him. It didn't seem to help though as more blood poured out. She could also feel his previously strong body become suddenly frail. She ran as fast as she could, and before long, she found just who she needed. It's withdrawals. Cecilia sat beside Dirk's bed. Sitting across from her was a doctor, someone with the light attribute who specialized in healing. After bringing Dirk in, Cecilia had this doctor personally take care of him, using her name as a Marcianus and the threat of death if he didn't move. Luckily, he didn't resist and immediately got to work. With a bit of healing magic and potions, Dirk's body was stabilized. He remained conscious through the entire thing, even now as the doctor explained what caused this sudden change. Cecilia frowned as the man adjusted a monocle. When a person uses potions constantly over long periods of time or gets their body repaired by healing magic just as often, their bodily systems become dependent on the potion or healing to function. I've seen it a lot in dungeon divers who consistently sustain wounds and then consistently get artificially healed. After a long time, their body can't function without it, and if they stop, they'll experience an adverse reaction. It usually results in being sick for a few days and weakness in the body. It also affects the weak more than the strong, so people at a certain level can ignore withdrawals outright. But not only is your son only rank 4, but I've never seen such an extreme case of this condition. Your son would have died without intervention, and it took a shocking amount of healing potion to stabilize him. Both Dirk and his mother frowned deeply at his words. Dirk immediately knew the situation while Cecilia could surmise it. The doctor continued. He'll need to remain here for at least two weeks as we allow his body to reacclimate. He'll need a regular dose of healing potion that I'll personally adjust every day. And I'll warn you in advance, but the process will be very uncomfortable. He may not be able to even walk for the duration. He just needs to rest until he's no longer dependent. I understand. Thank you, doctor. Of course. With a nod, the man stood and left. He closed the door to the room, giving them privacy. Do you want to explain? Cecilia asked cautiously. She didn't want to bring up his traumatic time at the mountain, but she wanted to know how serious the situation actually was. Dirk just sighed and spoke bluntly. I was beaten near death every single day for those two and a half years. Every time I was, I was given a potion from my bloodstream. Everything from broken bones to ruptured organs to shredded skin was regenerated within hours. Near the end, I could be up and walking in two hours. And I guess the only reason why I didn't react this way earlier was because I stole some potion and used it throughout my time in the jungle. It was only yesterday that I stopped using it. Oh God. Cecilia couldn't help the few tears that went down her cheek. She quickly composed herself though. She could imagine how strong the potion Dirk was given. Not just any potion could bring a man back from death's doorstep in mere hours. If she was being honest, she was baffled by the strength of the potion Azura used and how long he supplied it for. It spoke volumes about the depth of his organization. 
Either way, Dirk was given that potion every day for around 900 days. It was no wonder his body reacted so violently when the potion suddenly stopped coming. As Dirk had already guessed with spite, his body had even begun to replace food with the potion. Dirk didn't even feel hungry in the several days he was in the jungle. The potion replaced vital functions, and his body became reliant on it. It was like an addict suddenly coming off of a drug, only much worse in the backlash. Now, he had to slowly get his body to work as it did before. Only, when Dirk remembered the notifications he saw while collapsing, he knew that something deeper inside him was changing. Even now he could feel his body going through repairs and alterations. It was odd, but Dirk didn't mention it. Instead, he decided to change the topic. Although he was weak, he had no trouble ignoring the pain. He turned his head. Hey mom. Hmm. I have something I want you to see. Dirk smiled a bit as Cecilia's interest was piqued. Then, a cat suddenly appeared. Black fur, faint golden stripes, and deep golden eyes. Spite appeared in its cat form, looking very real but also a little ethereal at the same time. She was surprised by the cat that looked at her and flicked its tail around. Is it a fairy familiar? Cecilia made a guess as she reached out her hand. Dirk tilted his head at the new concept. Fairy? No. This is my stigma. I formed it while in the mountain. Your stigma? This? She was shocked as she pet the cat, feeling its warm, soft fur. Dirk also knew that this stigma was definitely out of the ordinary. For one, it had two forms. It was also modified and controlled by his AI interface skill. There was no part of this that was normal. But he showed it anyway. He didn't feel like hiding things from his mother. He only wanted to show her something he was proud of. Cecilia smiled a bit as the cat walked and sat on her lap. Your stigma. This is amazing. I've never even heard of a stigma like this. I've seen flying swords and a book that walks, but never an animal. Are you controlling it? No. An independent entity. Is it a boy or girl? Or, I don't know if it's even a proper living being. Nonetheless. She was even more surprised. This is by far the most unique stigma I've ever known of. What's it called on your profile? The Black Cat of Calamity. Calamity. She mumbled that word, finding it interesting. Thinking for a second, Dirk called back spite. There's also something else. It has another form. Another? Cecilia's eyes widened as the cat suddenly disappeared. In Dirk's weakly raised hand, the pistol appeared. He explained as she observed it. It's a magic tool that helps with my spellcasting. With it, I don't have to form magic circles. I can directly shoot the magic with this. While I still need to be proficient with the spells, it helps my magic abilities greatly. Dirk pointed the gun as he spoke. The golden circuits suddenly lit up, and runes appeared all around them. Cecilia was a bit mesmerized. More than that though, she was surprised by the detail of the weapon. Dirk, you were definitely weakened for a period after forming the stigma. How long was that period? Not any more than a few days. Why? A few days. Usually when someone forms their stigma, they're weakened for weeks, months, or even years depending on the person's strength. I couldn't fight for three weeks after I formed my stigma. The soul just takes that long to heal. Not only that, but stigma takes time to form. It could take months for the stigma to turn from a crude, unusable object to an actual tool. After forming my saber, I had to wait for two months before using it. Other people may have to wait years for theirs to form. How long did you wait? Maybe those few days? I didn't really have to wait. It was just finished by the time I woke up from recovery. I see. Cecilia nodded in thought. She then looked back at her son who was admiring his stigma. Her eyes widened when she saw his face though. You're bleeding. Hmm. Dirk was confused as his mother reached over and wiped his lip. There was blood streaming out of his nose. I'll get the doctor. 
It's okay, mom. If anything, I need to go to sleep. Dirk mumbled and sighed. When his arm dropped, the pistol in his hand transformed back into the cat. Spite laid on his lap, curling up. Seeing how haggard her son looked, she once again realized how much he had recently gone through. Not just at the mountain either. He had fought through that jungle to get to the city, and she knew how hostile it was. It was a miracle that he made it back alive. Of course, sweetie. Rest as long as you need. She planted a kiss on his forehead, stroking his cheek before covering him in blankets. She then left the room, spite watching her close the door. You really should go to sleep. Otherwise you might experience more pain than you want to right now. Yes, yes. And I'm basically numb to pain now, so it doesn't matter either way. Before I knock out though, tell me what's going on with my guts. Dirk settled into the bed as he spoke. Spite had actually been urging Dirk to sleep for a while, thus the reason he told his mother he wanted to rest. The reason was because of the potion withdrawals, or the reactions his body was having to the withdrawals. Spite rested itself in a crouching position. When the potion in your body ran out and ceased to provide its effects to your biological systems, your body began to both eat itself and decompose. It was like your organs just fell apart while your muscles decreased in mass. Even your skin corroded. There were very few parts of you that didn't immediately fall apart without the support of the potion. So what was with the activation of my trait? Your body wants to adapt. It wants to fill in the gap that the potion left by itself. Nearly every system in your body is attempting to restructure itself in order to provide the same effects as that potion, only constantly and without external supply. It's doing this in two ways. It wants to use the mana in your blood to mimic the magical effects of the potion, and your cellular genes want to achieve something like regeneration. Of course, naturally generating such significant changes isn't easy, so your nanites are operating under my directive to assist. All right. So my body is changing. Dirk mumbled in summary. In short, yes. Still, it's amazing how malleable your genes became after that trait activated. Right now you have hundreds of clusters of cells that are constantly mutating in order to achieve regeneration. Many of those cell clusters are forms of cancer. Cancer? Don't worry. Even if you did get cancer I could easily cure you. I'll take your word for it. Dirk frowned a bit unsurely. It was amazing the changes that were going on in his body without him knowing. So will I actually get regeneration? Like, grow back chopped off limbs type stuff? No, at least not right now. It'll likely be mild, just enough to cover the effects of the potion. You'll still enjoy the effects though. Assuming I don't get cancer instead. We'll see how the dice roll. Anyway, go to sleep. It'll be easier to work when your body is more vulnerable and defenseless. That's not comforting. Dirk rolled his eyes inwardly before sinking back into his bed. After that, it only took him several seconds to fall asleep. He was really fatigued despite his lively conversation. His body was quick to urge him into recovery mode. With that, Spite focused on working, carrying out biological experiments within the malleable vessel that was Dirk's body. Chapter 99, Recovery Slash Tensions Our son is back. City of Kalaba. Riker saw a single message on his transmission device. Unlike Cecilia who had scoured the entire empire, he was back home working on sorting through intelligence. He had taken on the role of a detective for his wife, and piles of paper had stacked themselves on his desks. Of course, that was all swept away by that one message. Without even thinking, Riker activated his magic in order to fly to the city his wife spoke of. He was a literal fireball that streaked through the sky. Using his full power, he was able to cross half the empire, a few thousand mile distance, in only two hours. Of course, he was exhausted afterward, but that didn't matter as much as seeing his son's face. Where is he? Riker burst through a door. Inside he saw Dirk sleeping on a bed and Cecilia sitting next to him. He ran over, immediately seeing the new face of his son who had disappeared two and a half years ago. He's grown. 
yet he's still our son. Cecilia smiled lovingly as she combed Dirk's hair. Hearing those words, Riker couldn't be more relieved. He had also been worried about Dirk changing. It seemed the best case scenario occurred. After combing back Dirk's hair though, Cecilia frowned again. Riker noticed this and sat down beside her. What's wrong? Dirk used vines from the jungle, tying them to his arms. Since he was weak, I took them off. But. She pulled back Dirk's sheet a bit. Then, Riker saw his arm. Along the forearm was a complex metallic tattoo with a large number 8 on it. He was Harbinger 8. Riker almost growled as he realized what it was. Azura wasn't the only one who tormented the Empire. Azura had been a problem for dozens of years, long before Cecilia had ever been tormented by him. And across all that time, he had worked to develop his assassin organization, the Fallen Azuras. And he had success. There were two types of people under Azura. There were the normal underlings, people who carried out orders depending on how strong they were. They disrupted all kinds of businesses all over the empire, being a prevalent nuisance that nobody even knew existed. Then, there were the Harbingers. The Harbingers were the most highly skilled and capable of the assassins under Azura's command. They were unpredictable and impossible to deal with. To many nobles with a high degree of intelligence, they were a famous group of people capable of planting seeds of chaos. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that if Azura wanted a civil war within the Horizon Empire, they would be able to create one. They were weapons capable of bringing down entire nations. Cecilia herself was one of these people. She was Harbinger 7. Beside her, there were six other Harbingers, and they were all loyal to Azura. They were his hands and feet, his tools of chaos. And it was because of the fact that Cecilia had defied him that Azura regarded her as his greatest failure. Never before had he failed to raise a harbinger. And while Riker knew that there were deeper conflicts between the two, Cecilia never spoke of it. Either way, Dirk was intended to be Harbinger 8. If Cecilia hadn't found Dirk, or more like if the Emperor hadn't stepped in, Azura may have gotten his way. Just the potion withdrawals told her that he had plans that went beyond even Dirk's knowledge. Not even Dirk could have guessed that the thing that was keeping him alive would also be able to kill him. He had been dependent, and that was one more tool to use to control Dirk. If Azura had been given more time, then even if it were Dirk, he wouldn't have lasted. Azura would have had another harbinger. But this also caused Riker to sigh in relief. They had gotten lucky. He smiled a bit. We must thank the Emperor. There's not much we can give him. Our skills are more than enough. Especially your skills. And. I have a feeling he'll need us soon. Riker frowned as he spoke ominously. Before Cecilia could ask what he meant though, the doctor came back in to do a checkup. With that, the parents shook their heads, ridding themselves of dark thoughts. Their son was back, alive and not dead. It was a happy situation, so they enjoyed it. After falling asleep, Dirk didn't wake up for an entire four days. To his parents, it was a coma that wasn't that uncalled for. He had been traumatized both physically and mentally. Now that he was finally safe, his body and mind were recuperating. But while this was somewhat truthful, the main reason was due to spite. If Dirk knew that spite was going to knock him out for several days, he may have commanded it otherwise. But since he was deep asleep, it wasn't his problem. And in fact, Spite wasn't just recklessly playing around with Dirk's body. Over time, his situation only continued to deteriorate, beyond what even the doctor was aware of. While the potion that the doctor gave him frequently helped, it wasn't enough. Spite realized that Dirk's body truly was dependent on the potion in every sense of the word. At some point, he stopped being able to live without it. And removing this dependency could now only be done in two ways, according to Spite's observations. One, he could expel all his existing bodily systems like his organs and muscles and then regrow them. The regrown systems wouldn't be dependent. Of course, this method was close to impossible. And if he did go down that route, it would take years to recover. It wasn't feasible. 
so then there was option two. Dirk's body needed to adapt, replacing the potion with natural genetic and magical systems. This was what Spite worked on. And Spite had small success. Dirk's genetic code was changed and adapted, slowing his deterioration. His blood that was filled with mana and anima also helped, seemingly attempting to replace the function of the potion automatically. After all, potions were both material and magical. But even after four days, Spite wasn't able to solve the root of the problem. Dirk's body continued to destroy itself, and only with the potion the doctor gave was he able to stay alive for a bit longer. It was no longer a matter of weaning him off. It all came down to when his body adapted. It was on the fourth day of his sleep though that something outside happened. Spite had always sat with Dirk and watched the surroundings, keeping a keen eye out like an actual cat. So when a man came walking into the room followed by Dirk's parents, Spite turned its attention. Spite was like Dirk who saw things through mana. Thus, when it saw the dark mana around the man be purged in its entirety, it raised its vigilance. Even more so when it felt pressured by the man's presence. He was a beacon of absolute power. Growl. Spite couldn't help but let out threatening sounds as the man approached Dirk's bedside. Cecilia saw this and stepped forward. Black Cat, this is the Emperor, an ally. Isn't this interesting? The Emperor, the man with the overpowering presence, mumbled as he looked at Spite. Spite looked back with its golden eyes as if telling him to keep distance. The Emperor ignored the cat though as he quickly shifted his gaze to Dirk. He wanted to see this child who now turned out to be another harbinger. When he looked at Dirk's body though, he got a glimpse of what was happening inside of him. Nobody knew how powerful the Emperor was, but it was generally agreed upon that he was the strongest existence in the Empire, and one of the strongest in the world. He could easily see Dirk's entire situation with but a mere glance. Of course, it was rude to probe a person's body with magic, but when the Emperor saw what was happening, he couldn't help but look deeper. Your son is continuously dying. Sorry? Cecilia's eyes widened at his words, her worry suddenly surging. His body is destroying itself. Without that potion, he can't live. He's fully dependent on it. If left alone, he would need a constant potion stream for the rest of his life. W what? But? It seems like he's doing something about it, as impossible as that sounds. The Emperor leaned over as his deep voice shook Cecilia's ears. She stood back. Unlike most people, Cecilia knew that the Emperor was someone who wielded the fire and light elements. Fire was his primary specialization, but he was absolutely powerful with the light element as well. That meant he likely knew how to heal, and he could help Dirk. After a while, the Emperor smiled. He looked at Spite who still maintained its vigilant gaze. Hard at work? This should lighten your load. Do make use of this opportunity. The Emperor put out his hand. And it was a red pearl. Cecilia was surprised. That's a bit of condensed bone marrow from an unknown animatype monster that I was given. If used in alchemy, it would be a great ingredient for healing potions. Normally nobody would have much use for it by itself. But, this case is special, isn't it? The Emperor moved his hand to spite. The cat looked at the red pearl, then back at the Emperor. Standing, it grabbed the pearl with its mouth before walking to Dirk and dropping it in his. Dirk swallowed the pearl unconsciously. Nothing immediately happened after that, but the Emperor knew the changes that were going to come about. He nodded to spite. That wasn't all though. The Emperor grabbed Dirk's arm seeing how Spite was a bit less vigilant. He looked at the metal tattoo and the large number 8. This will be easy to take care of. Right as he said that, he pointed one of his fingers at the tattoo. A sharp flame ignited on the tip, and he lowered it to the metal. Under that fire, the tattoo just burned away. The Emperor traced all the metal before getting rid of the large number 8. Raw skin was left behind where the tattoo was, but it immediately healed when he used some light magic. All traces were gone. Good. As for this. Finally, the Emperor frowned. He looked at Dirk's eyes. 
the cloth had long been removed, exposing the cursed cracks underneath. Can you restore his vision? I don't know. The emperor mumbled unsurely at Cecilia's question, touching the cracks. A strain of light came out of his fingers, seeking to purify the dark curse. Right when the light touched the cracks though, the emperor pulled back. Dirk's body also momentarily shivered, blood seeping from his eyes. Damn you, Azura. What happened? The curse is almost linked to his life. It ingrained itself deep, only stopping before being engraved into his soul. My power is enough to erase the curse, but Dirk isn't strong enough to survive the backlash. As of right now, he's stuck with it. At the very least, it doesn't go beyond blinding him. It seems like Azura isn't stupid enough to ruin a harbinger over a bit of frustration. The Emperor backed away while Cecilia clenched her fists. Well, your son will be fine, regardless. Thank you, Emperor. Cecilia bowed a bit, as did Riker. Although Dirk wouldn't get back his vision, he was going to live. That's all they cared about. The Emperor turned back to them. On another note, your son is, a bit special. Rest assured, once he recovers, he'll be able to go back to things like normal. Azura won't try anything, so even if he's alone, there won't be any lingering threats. And, here's something that belongs to him. The Emperor brought up his hand again. And it were two books. They were Dirk's two training manuals. I got them while going through the mountain, along with a few other books. Tell Dirk that, although I know it's not entirely his fault, he shouldn't withhold original magic texts. Original texts? My son has never even seen one. Due to the whimsy of a certain someone, he actually has. He's not in trouble and he probably didn't get anything from it, but nevertheless, just pass along my message when he wakes. He'll know what I'm talking about. I don't blame him for getting roped into trouble if it's that man. Carol. Riker spoke the man's name as he guessed some of the situation. He nodded to the Emperor. I will speak to my son. Sure. Then, I must go. In fact, Marquis Strider, since you're here, I ask if you could walk with me. Of course. Riker nodded, the two men walking out together. Cecilia watched them before turning back to Dirk. If she was being honest, at this moment, she cared about nothing other than her son. Tensions are only getting worse. The Emperor spoke as he and Riker left the hospital building they were in. The hospital was actually inside of the palace that was in the center of the city of Calaba. The palace was massive and luxurious, so it had many functions while being inhabited by the highest profile persons in the city. A butler showed the two to a secluded room. Inside this room there were already a few other people who looked more like soldiers. One of them was specially decorated with medals and royal robes. He had a sharp demeanor, his eyes hiding vast wisdom. General. Emperor Horizon. The general bowed at the waist before nodding to Riker. Riker nodded back as the three approached a table. There was a magic map on it as well as a few papers. The emperor continued his original statement. Our southern border is already experiencing conflict. It's been a problem for a couple years now, but it's become especially bad in the last few months. The Dark Kingdom has deployed a large portion of their forces and we've had no choice but to respond. There haven't been any battles and we've entered a stalemate. Now, it's about time for diplomatic negotiations. This is where the problem lies, though. Emperor, if I may ask, why is there such sudden friction? There haven't been any major changes, and because the Queen of the Dark Kingdom has been the sole ruler for hundreds of years, there aren't any political shifts to worry about. Has the queen perhaps had a change of heart? Riker asked. Since he was here, it was obvious the emperor wanted to include him in this discussion. The Horizon Empire occupied the northwestern part of the massive continent. Below them was the Dark Kingdom who occupied the direct western section of the continent. There was only one supercontinent in this world, and it took on the form of a poorly shaped donut. Around it was ocean, and in the center of this donut continent was a small sea. Thus, both the Horizon Empires and the Dark Kingdom's territories extended to both the Central Sea and Outer Ocean. 
there was a single horizontal line that comprised their border. It was the part of the border that was near the Central Sea where this friction was being seen. Riker had actually heard of this progressively worsening situation, as had the rest of the Empire. Only, the Dark Kingdom wasn't giving any reasons for their sudden aggression, so it was causing a bit of panic. Now, the two opposing forces had finally entered a stalemate. There would either be talks or an immediate battle. Of course, nobody even thought that the Dark Kingdom would just suddenly go to battle without stating their reasons. Not even their own citizens would allow that. Thus, they were waiting for messages to be sent. But the Horizon military wasn't one to just sit back and wait. They had already collected intelligence. The Emperor stood imposingly. You're correct that the Queen of the Dark Kingdom has dominated her people for hundreds of years. And usually, when political shifts or even uprisings are seen, they're promptly taken care of. But this time, it's everyone. The entire political circle of the kingdom is calling for change. And not even the queen is stopping it. From what I've heard, it's actually economic, the reasons for their aggression. Resource shortages? The opposite, actually. They've recently experienced surges in industry and capital. The entire kingdom is in an economic boom. But this is the source of conflict. The Dark Kingdom frequently trades with the Elven World Tree, as well as us. But they don't directly trade with the most prosperous empire in the world. The Dwarven Haven. Correct. We could be said to be inhibiting them with our territory. And they're pushing military forces toward the land that would connect them with the dwarves. What does that tell you? They want a direct channel with the dwarves. But is that not something we can facilitate? We fought the bloody war with them fifty years ago, but things have settled. If anything, this could be a chance to strengthen our ties. That's a good question that we'll have to ask. But that's also why we believe there's something else going on. Regardless of what it is, they want our land that connects to the Central Sea. Riker, can I trust you? Suddenly, the Emperor turned. Riker became solemn at the question. This was asking if he wanted to be involved in a deeper struggle that he couldn't back out of. But Riker wasn't afraid of any kind of struggle. He had been a military man before becoming one of the Academy's administrators. He was no stranger to war and battle or even political struggles. War was how he garnered his achievements, specifically his performance in the bloody war he spoke of. Not only that, the Emperor was the reason he was able to get his son back. He had been wondering how to repay him. This was his chance. I, Marquis Strider, am at His Majesty's service. My flame is yours to command. Riker got on one knee, kneeling before his Emperor. The Emperor smiled before patting his shoulder. Rise, Marquis Strider. I accept your pledge. Now allow me to tell you something very important. The Emperor turned to the table. On it was a map of the world. In the center was the Central Sea. There was actually an island within the Central Sea, as well as a land bridge leading to it. The Emperor pointed to the land bridge. The territory around this bridge cannot be taken, no matter what. This is something I will go to war over. I understand. Riker nodded a bit stiffly. If the Dark Kingdom wanted a direct route to the Dwarven Haven, they would be cutting off their access to that land bridge. Now, Riker was understanding how serious of a matter this was. The Dark Kingdom wanted greater prosperity, and the Horizon Empire wouldn't budge an inch. Although the Emperor didn't give him a reason why, it was apparently important enough to go to war over. As Riker understood, the Emperor smiled. This will be important information. Especially when you go as an envoy of the Horizon Empire to engage in diplomacy. I'm sorry. Riker was stunned at the implied command. He composed himself though and frowned. The Dark Kingdom hasn't said anything to us, though. Well, they haven't said nothing. In fact, if not for the recent conflict, I would have thought they were being friendly when they sent me this. The Emperor took out an envelope as he said that. He handed it to Riker. An invitation to the annual holiday, Advent of the Dark Dragon. They sent me this a month ago. The holiday is in five weeks. 
I'm currently planning on sending you, a duke, and some other delegates. What do you say? It should be a relatively enjoyable trip. If you believe I am fit, then I will be your envoy. Good. Then that's all I have for you. Tomorrow I will go back to the capital. Take your time here before returning with your son. And since you are my envoy now, I will give you this. The emperor held out his hand. And it was a ring with a large metal seal on it depicting a large sword and a flame. It was a royal seal, and out of the three ranks of silver, gold, and crystal, it was a gold seal. That seal will give you access to any teleportation platform in the empire, as well as a large sum of money to access from the treasury among other special items. I know the artifact you used while in the war was taken back upon your discharge. Go ahead and grab it from the imperial armory. Thank you, Emperor. Of course. And? The Emperor suddenly had an odd smile. His gaze turned toward where Dirk would be located, as if seeing him through the walls. When you go to the holiday in five weeks, take your son with you. Ethan? Dirk? Riker went quiet. His son Ethan was in the military, so he figured the Emperor would mean him. But it was actually Dirk he specifically wanted to go. This caused Riker to frown though. With everything that had happened, did he want to even remotely involve his son in this? I'll think about it. Of course, but know that I'm insisting this to some extent. Anyway, I'll need to speak to the city governor. He's been itching to have a dinner. All of you are invited, if you so please. With that, the emperor finally left. Riker was left pondering the future, brooding over the emperor's suggestion. Chapter 100, Restoration Slash Project It was three days after Dirk was given the condensed bone marrow from the Emperor. At this moment, nobody was in the room with Dirk. He had yet to wake up. But suddenly, he started coughing. It was soft at first, but then, each cough let out streams of blood. Spite watched as Dirk turned the bed red. After a while though, the red blood turned clear he started coughing up a water-like substance. It was potion. A large amount of potion was coughed up. In fact, it was all the potion that was inside Dirk's body, including the blood that was mixed with the potion. Spite was getting it all out. But this set off a reaction. Dirk's body began destroying itself like before. But Spite just let it be. Spite even got rid of the potion drip that was sending more potion into his body. Dirk's skin went from healthy to pale white. His subsiding coughs came back as he let out more blood. It looked like he was dying. But Spite waited. And sure enough, after twenty minutes of this, Dirk still wasn't dead. His body was destroying itself, but it was also keeping itself alive. Spite viewed the energies in Dirk's body. The anima in his blood streamed into the organs and flesh that were breaking down. The decaying cells were rapidly replaced by his blood and natural regeneration. The earth mana inside of Dirk seemed to make his still alive body parts remain that way, making his flesh stronger and more resilient. The fire mana seemed to blaze with vitality. Several of Dirk's biological systems rapidly failed and broke down. But as they did, the fruits of Spite's labor kicked in, and they were rebuilt just as fast. The nanites in Dirk's body were especially active. They moved with Dirk's body, both following its commands and giving out its own. The two worked in harmony, and Dirk's physical body was constantly rebuilt. It was a cycle of death and reconstruction that occurred everywhere from the muscles to the organs to the bones. And then, once everything had run its course, Dirk's body settled. It then surged in vitality and strength. Alert! Skill Acquisition Detected You have gained the skill, Restoration, Grade 5. Dirk's complexion quickly recovered after this notification was seen by Spite. The cat sat there, an odd sense of satisfaction gracing its mind. Then, it tilted its head. He's a man. He likes women. Should I be a girl then? I don't have a humanoid body, but he'd like the voice better than a robotic one. Ugh. Dirk grunted as Spite began to trail off with its, her, thoughts. He wiped his face that had blood over it. Welcome back. 
Spike called out with a slightly more feminine voice. Dirk rapidly saw what happened with his body, including the skill acquisition. Instead of being happy though, he sat up with a frown. When he pushed himself into a standing position, he felt his muscles that were strengthening by the minute. He was still weak, but he was going to recover. He was also hungry. But this sensation was overshadowed by the surge of rage he felt. That. That son of a bitch. Bang. He turned and swung his leg, kicking the bed. The metal of the bed frame was dented by his bones, also leaving behind small fractures and split skin on his shin. That damned scum. Fucking no life. You think you can get me addicted to potions? Do you have nothing better to do? You, you almost had me. When I get my hands on you, I'll restore your sight just to gouge out your eyeballs. Ack. Boom. A wall was cracked under Dirk's powerful fist. He took deep breaths of frustration, reining himself in. He turned his head, seeing his mother in the doorway. And seeing her sorrowful face made him feel bad. She was worried about these kinds of things, and he had tried to lessen her guilt. Now he slipped up. He looked at her straight though. He wasn't going to apologize. Instead, he felt something else. He suddenly remembered two and a half years ago when he was first taken. He remembered the hate in his mother's eyes when Azura stopped her. He remembered what she said. I'm going to hunt you down. I'll kill every Azura I find. I'll dismantle everything you've worked for. I may not be able to kill you, but I'll ruin everything you've built. Before, he had understood her words from the standpoint of bringing down an enemy. To destroy an enemy, it was natural to destroy everything they've built. Bring them down while their kingdom crumbles. But now, he understood it differently. Was it revenge? Vengeance? No, Dirk didn't want to get back at Azura, returning the pain he gave him. This wasn't an eye for an eye situation. No, it was just sheer rage and hate. Dirk couldn't stand the thought of Azura gallivanting around the world doing as he wished. He couldn't stand Azura getting what he wanted. He was his nemesis, an enemy that he must bring down at all costs. By all things holy I will hunt you down and bring you to your knees. And I'll be damned if I don't have fun doing it, just like you had fun watching me shed rivers of blood. Dirk made his vow with a sharp smile. The smile quickly went away though as he turned toward Cecilia. Mom. Yes, my child. You said that you'd bring him down. Cecilia shivered a bit at his words. Was his resentment finally spilling out? She stood there as she prepared to accept any hate he had for her. Dirk couldn't help the corner of his mouth that twitched upward. But. I'm kind of glad that you didn't. I suddenly had some ideas. I was thinking you and I could work together. We could go on a couple dates like before, destroy some hideouts, maybe kill a couple Azuras. It'll be our mother and son project, except the project is hunting down Azura's damned organization and not somewhat carving like in school. What do you think? I guess it might be a bit weird for me to say that so outright. I like it. Cecilia suddenly spoke. After being stunned for a bit, she raised her head with her hands on her cheeks. She seemed, oddly happy. I love it. Me and my son, hunting down heathens like pathetic cattle. Plotting out their demise and watching them fall into despair as everything crumbles around them and their souls shatter into damnation. And, chaining Azura up like a dog, torturing him for hundreds of years as his lifespan slowly reaches its end. I'm sorry. Cecilia suddenly stopped her wild imagination with a red face. Meanwhile, Dirk was a bit taken aback, though he quickly recovered. He walked over to his mother with a smile. So, that's a yes? Yes. I'd love to work with you, my child. We'll take him down together. It. It makes me really happy. My boy is all grown up now. Cecilia quickly hugged Dirk, squeezing him tight with a big smile. Dirk also smiled, though he clenched his teeth as his weakened body was crushed a bit. Ah, uh, Mom. Oh. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I'm alright. 
Dirk chuckled a bit as he sat back down on his bed. He still had blood on him as well, but it didn't seem like his mother saw it at all as she got some on her clothes after hugging. I've overcome the dependency. I'm just recovering strength now. Ah, is there food I can eat? I'm really hungry. Of course. Stay here, I'll be right back with a meal. Cecilia rushed out with those words. Dirk just sighed, relaxing his body that was still repairing itself. Well that was new. Right? A little sadistic, but that's alright. It's fine if it's mother. On the other hand, you've got some explaining to do. A week? I'd like you to tell me before putting me in a coma. Dirk shot a glare at the cat beside him. The cat just responded with a weird smile. Excuse you, but I was keeping you alive. I even got you a skill. You know, you're quite sassy for an AI. I'm a cat. I do my best. Spite raised her head as if smirking at Dirk. His mouth twitched as he picked her up by the scruff. And that voice. What's with that? I thought you'd like a bit more personality to the voice inside your head. My compliments sound better now since I'm a girl, right? What? What compliments? All I've been getting is attitude. Does it naturally come with the female tone? Oh, my bad. Should I praise you for a successful recovery? What a stud muffin. Oh wait, that was me. Wah. Shut up. After a bit of bickering with the cat, Cecilia came back with a large platter. Dirk dropped spite before digging in. The food that fell into his stomach was digested as if lit on fire. Cecilia made sure to bring many large servings, and it was the highest quality food in the city. Dirk felt tears come to his eyes as he ate the unfathomably delicious food. He swore never to eat slop again. Nutrients were infused into his body along with rich sources of mana. Dirk could feel his body recover as it happened. His muscles grew, his bones hardened, his organs were vitalized. Everything that had been breaking down was brought back to its peak shape. It wasn't long before Dirk got the strength to fight again. Even Cecilia was startled by his sudden changes. That was when he told her. I got a skill. It's called restoration, and it's grade 5. Ah, skill? Yes. How? She was shocked at his words. Dirk was only 16, and he had already gotten a skill. Since when were skills so easy to get? Dirk shrugged. I just got it while recovering. Spite told me about the bone marrow the emperor gave me, so I think that was it. Spite? The cat. Spite walked over at that moment. Cecilia nodded in understanding, but quickly became curious. So you two can talk? We can. Oh. Well hello. Hello. Spite nodded her head at Cecilia's surprise. She heard a feminine voice, becoming even more curious about the nature of the cat. Dirk spoke while eating. Anyway, I got that skill. I also have two others. Both are grade 5. There's a technique called mana lungs and my mana heart technique. I got a skill after reaching tier 3 and perfecting its usage. Now I breath in mana passively. I see that. Cecilia nodded. She was powerful and naturally sensed Dirk's effects on the surrounding mana. The second skill is called mana resonance. I got it while learning to enchant. Wait, resonance? Uh. Cecilia suddenly became hasty, activating magic and creating an isolation barrier around them. Dirk perked up as noodles fell from his mouth. Dirk, sweetie. Just a little advice, but never speak of that skill to anyone. Why? While in enchanting class, they probably called the ability to enchant a gift, right? Yes. His brow raised, despite not being able to use his eyes. Cecilia shot him a weird smile. Well, it's not. Truth is, the industry is heavily controlled and monopolized. They will come after you if you're found to know the truth about enchanting. While it isn't some revolutionary secret to know, the world's economy could shift if the knowledge were widespread. 
although nothing will happen to you with me around, I'll still advise you to just keep that skill a secret. Okay? Dirk was a bit confused. He had inferred that details about enchanting were being hidden, but he didn't realize it was such a big deal. Still, some people would do anything for money and control, so he understood to just keep a tight lip. Not that he would go speaking his skills to any random stranger anyway. Nonetheless, I'm very happy that you've trusted me enough to tell me. And very proud that you got those skills. Such a talented child. Cecilia rubbed his head with a happy smile. Dirk just smiled as he continued eating food. She watched Dirk eat a bit, also taking little bites herself here and there. Once he was full, he looked noticeably healthier. She nodded at that. I guess if you're healthy, we can head back to the capital soon. Your father has already returned for some work. As for you, once we get back, you should work on your mana technique. I can also take you out for some excursions. I've already hit most of them, but there are still remnant Azura groups that remain in the capital. All right. Only if you're okay with it. Cecilia's voice quieted a bit. Dirk, I know what you went through was horrible. It's a hell I wish you were never put through. But the things they taught you, they can be used. The lethal magic, the movement techniques, the knowledge, the protocol. Azura wanted to turn you into a harbinger. You'll begin to learn what that means later, but what you were taught was truly specialized stuff. We're here now, and if you're ready, we can move to turn the abilities Azura gave you against him. If you're ready to spill blood and massacre the hundreds and thousands under Azura, then I'll support you. But only if you're ready. You're not going to be forced to do anything. It's okay, Mom. Dirk quickly replied to his mother's worry. He smiled with no amount of hesitation or conflict. Azura doesn't deserve the goodness of my conscience. I've already killed some of his men. I was more happy than anything else then. So I plan on enjoying our work. And it'll be fun to enjoy it with you, Mom. I'm the luckiest mother in the world. Cecilia sniffled a bit as she fanned her face in happiness. Dirk chuckled a bit awkwardly. Was there another mother in this world that encouraged the coordinated massacre of assassins? Probably not. He thought he was lucky though. I'm the luckiest child in the world. Dirk and his mother took another day to explore the city of Calaba, going on their own date. While doing so, Cecilia happily told him about the recent news she heard from her husband. The border friction, the Dark Kingdom, the potential outbreak of war, and the upcoming holiday that the Emperor suggested Dirk go to. Dirk was a bit surprised by all this information that was likely confidential. Other than that, she went on and on about the things that Dirk missed over the last couple of years. Ava was now a fourth year at the Academy, and her power had grown greatly under Cecilia's tutelage. She constantly went on dungeon dives, sharpening her combat skill. Her skill in alchemy also increased, now being one of the top junior alchemists in the academy. And from Cecilia's words, she had grown quite a bit just like Dirk, turning into a very fine young woman. Cecilia couldn't help but snicker a bit as Dirk got a bit restless over her mention. Alec had also gotten famous. In his age group, he was one of the strongest and most valiant fighters. He had formed a powerful group for dungeon diving, one that included Ava. He was also known for taking on jobs that included hunting down bandits and guarding caravans, becoming a reputable defense force. It was said that he'd be joining the military soon. Other than that, there wasn't much that Dirk had missed. Cecilia also mentioned Tobastin who had become worried after Dirk disappeared as well as Geralt who disappeared not long after Dirk did. Geralt's whereabouts were unknown, a sentence that gave Dirk an odd feeling of fear. Dirk and his mother took in all the sights and pleasures the city had to offer. Food, drink, gambling, music, and shows. There seemed to be everything in this city. If it were a bit more modernized, Dirk would think he was walking through a city on Earth. In fact, this place was a bit more fantastical with floating lights of mana and magicians performing grand parlor tricks for the crowds. Of course, if Dirk could see more, he would likely enjoy it more but he could get the gist of the things going on around him, so he just enjoyed himself and his happy mother. 
his dark mana vision was at least getting better bit by bit. And when the next morning came, Cecilia took Dirk to a large square near the center of the city. From this place, people and merchants appeared and disappeared with vast waves of dark mana. It was a teleportation platform, and with it, one could be teleported to several other cities in the empire. There was one such platform in the capital city, though Dirk had never seen it. Apparently it wasn't well known since only the richest merchants and highest profile persons could use them. Either way, Dirk was stunned as the two were teleported to the capital in an instant. It wasn't long before they left a massive building, walking onto the busy streets of the capital city. Waiting for them was Riker. Hello Dad. Dirk. It's good to see you kid. Riker smiled. Although Dirk had grown a lot, he was still taller. The next moment though, Riker frowned. I went to go find Ava before you came here. Really? Where is she? I'm not sure. Riker looked a bit concerned, causing Dirk's worry to rise. Their residence is completely empty. Chapter 101, See You Their residence, Ava's house, was completely empty. It was a bit alarming, but not in the sense of a life-threatening crisis. Ava wasn't in trouble. But Dirk really wanted to see her. There were very few important people in his life, and she was one of them. So he went to find her after getting the address for the house. As for Cecilia, she went to go find Alec who probably knew her whereabouts. It wasn't long before Dirk arrived. Since his father said it was barren, he decided to walk right into the front door. That's when he saw it. No furniture, no decorations, no rugs, and no signs of life. There was nothing but outlines of dust on the floor. So Dirk searched the house. And he found nothing. It was an entirely abandoned house. Right when he was feeling panicked though, Cecilia arrived. I have bad news. She approached him who sat on a staircase. It seems, they left. Ava had come back from a dive only a few days ago. And yesterday, the family suddenly vanished. Alec's father told me they had suddenly decided to pull out of the empire. They even brought along their business. Why? The war. The entire empire has been worried about the tensions between us and the Dark Kingdom. It's gotten really bad recently. After all, our troops are practically lined up to fight. And, the last time a war broke out, it didn't end well for anyone. Dirk was silent. He understood how devastating a war could be. But it wasn't like Ava was in the military. As far as he knew, her father was just a businessman. But it seemed like there was more to the situation if he left at the signs of battle. So where are they? There's only one place they can be. They're taking a route to go east, which means they want to pass underneath the Dwarven Empire. Since they're hybrids, they're likely heading to the Unity Empire. How fast? If it's a full-scale migration, then even though the wagons might be fast, the logistics ensures it won't be. They've been traveling for 14 hours. Come with me. Cecilia suddenly waved after giving him the details. Dirk looked at her before standing and following. They headed toward a certain corner of the capital. Here, there was a military installation. Cecilia walked right in, and nobody stopped her. You've never actually learned how to ride a horse, have you? I have some idea. I'm sure you could learn on the fly either way. As she said that, the two walked into a stable. Inside were long rows of horses of all sizes and colors. Some looked almost like unicorns while others swirled with large amounts of mana. Cecilia stopped at one of them. It was an all-black horse whose glossy hair emitted a black fog. Dirk could feel the dark element from it. I've been using this horse recently. He moves faster than you think, so you'll need to stress yourself to use his full speed. That also means he'll get you to where you need to go quickly. He can also hide well, and you don't need to worry about losing him. He'll follow you. Anyway, take it. Now? The longer you wait, the farther she gets. Cecilia smiled at him. Dirk scratched his head before looking at the horse. At that moment, Spite also appeared. 
she looked into the horse's eyes from Dirk's shoulder. The horse seemed a little distressed at Spite's appearance, but bowed its head. Spite walked onto it from the nose until it sat on its back. Good horse. She seemed smug, to which Dirk smirked. He then jumped onto the saddle. Don't be gone too long, or I'll worry. I won't. Go. Nay. The horse let out an energetic sound at Dirk's command. Like that, he walked out of the stable and toward an exit not far from the military installation. Cecilia watched as he and the horse rode off into the distance as if flying. A trail of black thought was left behind. Damn you're fast! Dirk shouted a bit excitedly. The horse flew down a rough road at the top speed of some cars. Dirk's man of vision was stressed as he kept up with the changes in the surroundings. Luckily, the horse also knew how to steer itself and not blindly run into a tree. 148 miles per hour. Best part was, the horse didn't stop. Dirk had ridden this thing for three hours already, and it never even slowed down. It didn't even look tired. Dirk was getting tired faster, in fact. And he was happy about that. Because a bit before the fourth hour, when the sun was high in the sky, Dirk saw it. A massive caravan taking up nearly the entire road. Each of the wagons was five meters tall and up to twenty meters long. Guards sat on top of and within each wagon, and there were some riding horses all around it. It was a full escort force, a necessity with the quantity and quality of the cargo that was being moved. Dirk slowed down upon seeing the caravan. Both he and the horse activated their stealth abilities, and they remained hidden. Then, Dirk steered the horse into the forest beside the moving caravan. The caravan itself was moving surprisingly fast. They were going the speed of cars, around 60 miles an hour despite the rough road. It looked like they had suspension and special wheels though, enabling them to move so fast. If Dirk used his full strength and some magic, he might be able to move with the caravan. But the horse was a much more suitable option, a powerful animal that could go the speed of a sports car for hours on end. Unfortunately, because of the guards everywhere and how fast they were moving, Dirk wasn't able to find a way onto any one of the wagons. He didn't even know which one Ava was in, or if she was alone. So he waited. Dirk tailed them for several more hours. When the sun began to set, the carriages slowed down. Dirk watched as they stopped and set up camp. He also stopped, watching them nearby. Some guards remained as sentries, but he could deal with that. He kept his eye out. But Ava never showed. Dirk didn't get hasty though. He waited some more, and when the large group began making dinner outside, Dirk heard what he wanted. Ava, we've made dinner. Not interested. All right. Ava's father closed the door of a carriage after being grumbled at. Dirk felt his heart beat a little harder when he heard that voice. He walked around to that carriage. Looking at the wall, he saw a large window. It was closed, but Dirk didn't worry about that. Seeing as there weren't any sentries around and nobody within the window's line of sight, Dirk reached up. Using a bit of elemental sonar, Dirk found the lock of the window and used earth magic to move it. It clicked, and he quickly opened the window and slipped in. Who dash? SHH. Dirk immediately rushed at the young woman he saw, placing his hand over her mouth. She struggled, but when the two looked at each other, both froze. Dirk slowly removed his hand as Ava's eyes went wide. Although he couldn't see, he could make out Ava's figure from the earth and fire mana. She was taller, though a head shorter than him. This height was compensated for a bit by her antlers that had grown upward a bit and backward. It was forming into something like a crown, and she looked a bit majestic with it. Thankfully, it wasn't obnoxiously tall like her father's, only rising an inch or so above her head. Then, he could see her soft face. Her shapely curves. The long brown hair. And because his sense of smell was heightened due to the blindness, he could smell the natural aroma she emitted. It felt familiar despite so long having passed. I've never wanted my sight back more than now. Dirk cursed inwardly, stressing his dark man of vision to make out vague images of her. 
Still, even with the obscurity, his mother was correct. She was a very fine young woman. Dirk? Ava was also looking at him. Dirk had a cloth over his eyes, so she couldn't see the cursed cracks. But she could see his toned body underneath his casual clothes, along with the mature, sharp face. He looked so different yet familiar. Most of all, she couldn't mistake that aura. And the smell. Hi, Ava. You've changed. Why yeah? Dirk, what are you doing here? I should be asking that. I just got back, and you're trying to run away? I'm a little hurt. You. Ava was surprised at his tease, and she smiled when he did. You're such an ass. You were the one who was gone. I had to dungeon dive with Alec. Do you know how much slack I had to pull while you were gone? Are you telling me you couldn't complete jobs alone? I thought you had the skills. Ugh, shut up. When you were gone I... I wanted to get stronger. I was worried that when you came back, I wouldn't be able to beat you. I wanted to get stronger than that woman who took you. I thought maybe I could go and hunt you down then. Ava spoke through the tears that dripped down her cheeks, constantly wiping them away. Dirk went and hugged her, stroking her back in comfort. It's good to see you too, Ava. Hey, I'll have you know that I haven't cried in two months. You tell your mother that so she can stop calling me a crybaby. You're crying right now. It was still a new record. Ugh. I'm fine now. The two separated as Ava straightened her hair out. She then looked at him with a side eye before sitting on a nearby couch. So you want to tell me what your family is migrating for? Dirk sat down beside her. At first the two were separate, but after he smiled and waved, Ava laid against his chest. My father wants to escape the upcoming war. So I've surmised. But that doesn't seem like enough. There hasn't actually been an official declaration. So what's really going on? Ava was silent, struggling with something internally. She clenched his shirt a bit. He wants to escape the wartime law that may be imposed if a war does break out. The Empire can't have businesses, the backbone of its economy, doing as they please during a war. There will be more restrictions and investigations into suspicious activity. Okay? Does that mean? My father runs an illegal slave trading business within the Empire. Ava directly spoke, causing Dirk to shut his mouth. She curled up a bit, moving closer to him as if scared. A lot of the wagons in this caravan are filled with these slaves. And he can't abandon the business, so he's moving to where it isn't illegal. Where is that? The Hybrid Empire Unity, a place dominated by hybrid races of all kinds. It's supposed to be some kind of prosperous utopia for the strong. My father has family there, so he'll be welcomed. Him and his merchandise. Ava growled a bit. Dirk suddenly remembered a map in his mind. The Dark Kingdom directly to the west. The Horizon Empire above it to the northwest. The Dwarven Haven directly north to the right of the Horizon Empire. And then there was Unity, occupying the east of the continent next to the dwarves. They were basically on the opposite side of the world from the Horizon Empire, separated by the Dwarven Haven. And this was the problem. If she were there, then Dirk wouldn't see her again for a long time. Why? Dirk asked after some silence, causing Ava to bite her lip. I know your father wants to leave, but why do you have to go? He said there's an opportunity there. Hybrids have special inherent abilities and have something called bloodlines. These bloodlines can be awakened when one hits a certain level of power. He wants me to do so when I reach that level of power. Is that it? You can get as strong as you want even without some bloodline. So why? You could stay with us. You have friends here. So why? I. They're my family. Ava sat up suddenly, startling Dirk. It's my mom and dad. My dad's a heinous bastard in the Empire, but he's just a businessman in Unity. I don't like what he does, but at least he doesn't have to hide so much there. And my mom had been there for me all my life. I can't. I've never been without them. 
I can't just leave. Both of them want me with them, and Unity is supposed to be my home anyway. We're out of place in the Horizon Empire, even though it still has a lot of hybrids. I just can't dash. I understand. Dirk interrupted, grabbing her hand. If he understood anything, it was the love for one's parents. Dirk wouldn't be able to separate from his parents in such a situation. So he wouldn't ask her to. It's all right. You deserve to be with your parents. They'll be there to support you, and as you said, you can awaken your bloodline at Unity. It's not a bad thing, to go there. I'm sorry. Ava whispered as she touched her forehead to his. Her heart ached. Just as you came back. That doesn't matter. I'm just glad I got to see you one more time. He stroked her cheek, brushing her hair behind her ear. As if she were possessed, Ava suddenly pushed forward. She used a shocking amount of strength as she pulled their bodies together, planting her lips on his. She only got a few moments. Outside the wagon, fire crackled. Along with the explosion of an ember, Dirk seemed to see that whip coming down upon him. Crack! Ack! Dirk's body violently flinched, startling Ava as she pulled away. Sorry. Did I hurt you? No. I'm fine. Dirk shook his head a bit as he felt his back turn moist. Using elemental sonar, he saw the small bonfire that was set up outside. Ava turned a bit meek, thinking it was her fault. Sorry. I know you don't like that but… No. It's fine. He interrupted her. He remembered the last time this happened, feeling even worse than before. He tried to give an explanation. I just can't say we're old enough to be doing that stuff. We have to be adults. Are you asking me to wait for you? She looked into his eyes, surprising him a bit. You've gotten more direct, but yes, I guess you could say that. Mm, all right. Either way, I don't think we'd have a choice. Her voice drifted with a bit of sorrow. Then, she shook her head. She turned her attention to the strip of cloth over his eyes, seeking another topic of discussion. She reached for it. What is this, anyway? Are you doing some kind of training? Um. Dirk was a bit hesitant, but didn't back away as Ava lifted the cloth. She felt her heart drop when she saw the cursed crack sealing his eyes. What? I was cursed. It only blinds me, so I'm not being constantly hurt by it. You're blind? Those bastards, blinded you? Ava shivered a bit in rage. Blinding someone effectively disabled them. A blind man couldn't fight and couldn't live out a normal life. Vision was absolutely one of the most important tools to every being in the world. And losing it meant so much more than just not seeing anything. Ava couldn't believe that Dirk was actually blind. It's not as bad as you think. I was able to learn how to see through mana. Although it's not as nice as vision and I can't sense much beyond a certain range, it was able to keep me alive. I can see a lot of details, like the shape of your little nose and the strands of your hair. Although there's no color to anything, it's good enough. Good enough? Don't, don't say that. She clenched his shirt. She remembered that woman who took Dirk and felt blinding hatred. Hey! Dirk stroked her cheek, raising her head. Don't worry. Those people are going to pay. I'm going to bring them to their knees, and they'll hand over their lives. And when I'm strong enough, I'll be able to see properly again. Even before that time comes, I'll have created my own magic to let me see. The next time I see you, it'll be more than just an image. She nodded through half-gritted teeth, barely able to accept what happened. He smiled the next moment. And hey, I'm not any weaker. I'm actually quite a bit stronger. I think I can still beat you. These words seemed to perk Ava's competitive spirit. Washing away her hatred, she lifted her head with a smirk. Beat me? I'm almost tier 5, thank you very much. I'm also in the middle of rank 4. What about you? Still at the low end of tier 3. And I just got to rank 4. So it would be an even match then. Ugh, 
that's some arrogance. If you weren't so hot I'd say it doesn't suit you. Still, looks won't work on me, pretty boy. Ava pushed closer with a snarky grin, causing Dirk to chuckle. Hoo-hoo, well, I do have a trump card. I'm not sure you could handle it. What is it? Another layer of abs? Even better. It's a cat. Ha! Huh. Ava jerked back a bit as a tail suddenly brushed past her face. There was a cat beside them, and she looked at its large golden eyes. Cat? You know what a stigma is? This is mine. Oh. It's cute. The people who died while looking at me would think otherwise. And it talks? Ava was surprised as she heard a voice. Spite laid down next to them, getting comfortable. Don't mind me. Cats spend their entire lives sleeping, right? I guess I'll start now. Spite lowered her head as she said that, curling into a small ball. Ava gasped a bit at the cuteness. After that, Dirk and Ava spent a bit more time together. Since everyone was eating, and Ava had shown herself to be in a bad mood, nobody disturbed the wagon for a while. This gave them some much appreciated space. And for that short amount of time, they talked and cuddled their hearts out. They ignored what they knew would come. They focused on the moment. And then, there was a knock. Ava, sweetie? Are you sure you don't want a bite? Dinner will be over soon. It was Ava's mother. The two who had been laying on each other quickly got up. Ava bit her lip. I'll be out in a minute. All right. We have a plate for you. With that, the mother walked away. Ava's head hung as she felt her chest tighten. We're going to see each other again. Dirk eventually spoke. It was a vow and a promise. Ava nodded, lifting her head and clearing away bad thoughts. Yes, we will. I'm gonna get stronger. You're not gonna catch up to me. We'll see. And, maybe I should be the one to visit in the future. I haven't seen any other empires besides Horizon. I'd like to travel. How long? I mean, until you think about it. She got excited before stifling it in expectation. Dirk rubbed his chin with a cheeky grin. I think I'll give it a while. If I don't give you enough time to advance, I'll be too powerful for you to handle. Ugh, you're such a jerk. She snarled a bit before leaning forward. Dirk responded, and the two enjoyed one long moment in each other's arms. They separated when there was another knock on the door. Leaving a peck on her forehead, the most he was willing to do, Dirk turned and climbed back through the window. He hung a bit on its ledge, the two looking at each other through it. See you. He smiled before dropping, disappearing from view. Ava shook her head as she sniffled a bit. That's so not funny. Chapter 102, Usurp Dirk returned while the capital city was shrouded by night. He wasn't in the best mood, but he decided to be satisfied with seeing Ava once before she left. Upon arriving, he rode his horse back into the stable. Cecilia was there waiting for him. She saw that he didn't look happy, but it was good that he wasn't that angry either. I'm sorry, honey. It's fine. She wants her family. I'm not going to insist otherwise. Hmm. It's not easy, but there's always the future. Cecilia rubbed his back as she spoke lovingly. When her hand touched his exposed neck though, she stopped. What happened? She asked worriedly as she looked at her fingers. There was a hint of blood on them. Dirk hesitated a bit before taking off his shirt. Cecilia looked at his back which had the remnant scarring of whipping. There were over fifty different discolored lacerations that marred his skin. But, you healed. The caravan made a bonfire. Dirk turned, bundling up his shirt. An ember exploded. I heard the whip. When I left, I found blood on my back. The wounds, just appeared. Phantom scars. Cecilia spoke with mean eyes. It's pain that you feel when something triggers a, trauma. But it should be nothing more than pain. Because you remember the trauma so vividly and the pain feels real, your body effectively recreates the event. 
It's not voluntary. But why? I'm not afraid of some lousy piece of string. You underestimate what actually happened to you, my child. Cecilia walked around Dirk, tracing the scars on his back with gritted teeth. The whip they used. It destroys your mind. At some point, your body becomes able to handle any pain you throw at it. But, the mind is greater than the body. It can handle more. It has more capacity for pain. Those whips, starting at seven, no longer harm just your body but your mind. The level 10 whip is capable of destroying a person's mind, killing them while only wounding their body. It's an advanced curse magic. Dirk, your scars run deeper than your flesh. I'm just glad that you were able to survive what you did. She hugged him from behind, disregarding the dried blood on his skin. Dirk scowled inwardly. I've been traumatized by that man. Ridiculous. He refused to believe it. He had fought through everything, tooth and nail. Though, he was also beginning to see that there really was more to Azure's torture than he knew. First the potion withdrawals, and now the mental scarring. What more did that snake do to him? It pissed him off that something had slipped through his defenses. Oh well. Dirk eventually sighed. He didn't like worrying his mother, so he quickly moved on. The advent of the Dark Dragon, an annual holiday of the Dark Kingdom, was around a month away from the time Dirk made his recovery. Dirk had already talked with his mother about it. She and Riker would be going, so Dirk was going to join them. While Riker was going as an envoy of the Empire, Dirk and his mother would be going for the sake of getting out of the house. They had no responsibilities on this trip. But of course, they weren't totally uninvolved. As of now, the Dark Kingdom was hostile territory. Technically, for the duration of their stay, they would be political hostages. The armies at the border would be a bit on edge as they waited for this round of diplomacy to bear fruit. If anything big and bad happened, war could immediately break out. Of course, these political hostages were anything but helpless. Dirk and his mother were expert assassins even though Dirk didn't have the same sheer power. Riker was also a renowned battle mage, though Dirk had never actually seen his full power. Not only that, there would be a duke going with them, one of the few tier eights of the Empire. The combat strength of the envoys surpassed that of the armies on the border. From what Dirk surmised, a tier eight was nothing short of a tactical nuke, while tier sevens like his father could control entire battlefields. Long story short, even the weak Dirk would be perfectly safe so long as he wasn't isolated. Of course, Dirk wasn't planning on being weak for long. He hadn't been able to advance in power much at Azure's Mountain. But now that he had resources at his disposal and an accumulated elemental comprehension, he planned to make a jump. His first order of business was his fire and lightning mana heart. Like his earth and metal mana heart, he had to create the mana heart with equal amounts of both types of mana. This wasn't difficult at all, and after getting set up in a high-quality room at the Magic Pyramid, he had all the dense mana he wanted. And his growth truly was explosive. In a mere week, Dirk was able to push his fire and lightning mana heart near completion. After creating the rune for the heart and enchanting it, he smoothly triggered the advancement. It was a repeat of what happened with his earth mana heart. His awareness was pulled into the mana dimension, and he watched as his soul opened itself up. His mana heart that was half fire and half lightning sunk into the soul, filling the void. And now that he made proper preparations, Cecilia was on standby, and she crushed fire and lighting mana crystals to give Dirk plenty of fuel. It was a perfect advancement when the cavity in Dirk's soul was completely filled with mana. After a short amount of time, the fire mana heart appeared next to his earth mana heart. Both of them contracted with the beats of his physical heart, pumping dense amounts of every mana type into his blood. For a while, it made sparks and arcs jump around his skin until things settled down. Even Dirk's breath let out some flame, causing his mother to chuckle. Congratulations. Thanks. Dirk smiled. Only, this was just a small advancement. It would greatly increase his ability to wield fire and lightning mana, but his tier was still tier 3 dash. Getting to this point, Dirk frowned. To get to tier 3 mid, 
he would need to create his dark man heart. The only problem was the annoying bug in his way. Eldritch Primordial Dirk recalled those abyssal eyes within the mana dimension. Dirk had actually glanced at him while creating the fire mana heart. That dark being was always there, always watching him. And due to his godly powers, Dirk was unable to control any dark mana. Well, that's not completely true. Dirk did have access to a small reservoir of dark mana. This was due to the darkness that he wrested away from Eldritch Primordial. The small amount of darkness he took gave him access to that amount of mana. So there was only one way to continue advancing. It's time to pay him a visit. Dirk thought with a smile. He looked at his mother who was still with him in the mana room. She was excited about his advancement, but he decided to ride this wave of success. Give me a moment, Mom. Saying that, Dirk closed his eyes. He concentrated, and he looked to the door to the mana dimension. Normally it was sealed tight, but due to the advancement, it was still open. Dirk pushed through, and his awareness returned to his soul. Dirk smiled as he saw the ocean of mana around him. Then, he looked down at those dark eyes. How's it going, Eldritch? Remember that full course meal I promised to take? You dare step into death's domain? The dark being below screeched a bit in rage. Then, a small cluster of dark mana was shot at Dirk. Begone! Dirk watched as the cluster threatened to injure his soul. Unlike before though, he wasn't helpless. Cat. My name is Spite. Spite spoke as she appeared next to Dirk's soul. Shooting forward, she swam through the ocean of mana and intercepted the cluster. With a flick of the head, she snatched the dark cluster out of the air, swallowing it whole. At that moment, Dirk felt a bit more dark mana be made available to him. A simple game. Dirk nodded in agreement when Spite snickered. It was a battle for territory. Eldritch Primordial controlled all dark mana. So if Dirk wanted some, he just had to take it. Dirk had to trespass into the domain of chaos. Eldritch Primordial also knew this. But it wasn't angry. In fact, Dirk could sense a bit of glee. Come then. Dirk heard that grating voice, and tendrils rose up from the darkness. They stopped at a certain level, as if hitting a barrier. This was its domain. Dirk lowered himself into that domain. Hand your soul to me. With a clash of chaos and an ordered soul, a fierce battle of the elements ensued. Ugh. Dirk? Cecilia was suddenly startled when Dirk collapsed. From his mouth, eyes, and nose poured blood. His body shivered uncontrollably. But he was smiling. Before Cecilia could bend down to hold him, she suddenly felt dark mana surge toward his body. An advancement? She was startled before reflexively pulling out a dark mana crystal and breaking it, making the environment dense with dark mana. She then bent down and laid Dirk's body against hers. After a minute or so, his body calmed down, as did the surrounding mana. Cecilia watched as Dirk's complexion quickly healed. I. I did it. Dirk chuckled before his head went limp. Cecilia was worriedly confused as he fell asleep. At the same time, in the mana dimension, Eldritch Primordial was livid. Dirk had taken a lot of ground for himself. It was a grand battle between Dirk and Dark Mana taking all kinds of shapes and forms. Dirk not only had to defend, but usurp the Dark Mana for himself. It took a ton of energy to do this, and compared to the vastness of what Eldritch Primordial controlled, his effects were minuscule. But nonetheless, Dirk had carved out a domain of his own. At first it had been nothing. But now, if Dirk had to measure it in terms of depth within the ocean of mana, it was around 150 meters deep. It was at that point that Dirk had to stop because the resistance grew exponentially. He had pushed so far and felt like he got closer to Eldritch Primordial, nonetheless. While those abyssal eyes were still far away, they were definitely closer than before. Dirk could feel the presence of that dark being flow around him. One thousand meters. Spite suddenly spoke. She was also drained, but for her, it was only a matter of energy levels. 
Dirk's soul stood on the border of his domain. Is that how far you are? Dirk's eyes bored into Eldritch. He's 1,000 meters deep. Proportionally, you should be able to take 100 meters per tier. I'm lacking then. And tier 10 doesn't exist. Unless a tier 10 would be an existence like Eldritch. Probably. Only way to find out would be to get there yourself. Baby steps. Says the one who just performed a magical blitzkrieg on a god. Spite snickered, its whiskers twitching in excitement. After the battle, Dirk calmed himself. Fighting Eldritch wasn't like fighting a normal enemy. He had to combat all those dark tendrils and bullets and curses with his own power to wield elements. Dirk controlled earth, fire, metal, lighting, and dark mana as he moved forward. Thankfully, due to the recent small advancement he was able to squeeze out more energy than normal. It's curious though. He's so powerful and yet he can actually be pushed back. It's like he's being limited. I agree. But I doubt he's in any mood to satisfy our curiosity. Dirk looked into Eldritch's deep eyes. He had refused to speak when Dirk kicked him back. Perhaps there were sinister machinations brewing behind his vast mind. Either way, they weren't getting anything out of him. Anyway, time for me to get some sleep. Dirk immediately passed out when he said that. His physical body sleeping and his consciousness were two different things. He had kept himself awake, but he was utterly exhausted. After ensuring that things were safe, he finally let go. Fighting Eldritch Primordial for his domain was, in a way, a form of cultivating mana. It was much different than gradually increasing the density of his mana heart. Dirk's other elements didn't have anything like domains to invade and take. So Dirk needed to gather it himself and accumulate normally. But when he encroached on Eldritch Primordial's domain, the dark mana he took was immediately handed to him. There was no need to accumulate. The dark mana was now in absolute control of his soul to do whatever he wanted with. This was his domain. So when Dirk had taken a large enough domain, he realized that he was immediately able to create his dark mana heart. Like that. He simply pulled on the mana within his domain, instantly forming the mana heart and triggering his advancement. And now, Dirk had all three of his mana hearts. Of course, there were pros and cons to doing things this way. Dirk still couldn't control any dark mana outside of his domain. This basically meant that Dirk had a fixed pool. For Dirk's other elements, while he had a certain amount of mana in his mana pools, he could constantly regenerate his pool with mana lungs giving him magical longevity. But because he was fighting for his domain, he had an absolutely fixed dark mana pool. When he used it up, he could cast no more dark magic. This is when Dirk found something peculiar. His domain allowed him access to a certain amount of mana. But when he spent it, it gradually came back like regenerating energy. It wasn't like his other mana pools that naturally drew from the surroundings to recover mana. Dirk couldn't control the surrounding dark mana. So where was this mana regeneration from? Dirk wasn't sure, but whatever this source was, his domain controlled it. Thus, he had access to this regenerating source of dark mana. Dirk was happy. Of course, this didn't all come for free. He was pretty sure his soul was injured in the process. He woke up after a day of rest, and when he did, he felt a constant pain in his chest. It wasn't heartache, but pain coming from his soul. And even after several hours, it never went away. It always remained, just a dull ache that annoyed him. Of course, Dirk had a hardened mind, so he could bear it. Still, when three days passed and the pain never left, he began to think that this was permanent. That was when he went to his mother. She had been worried about him after his advancement, but he assured her it was nothing. She thought it was backlash from forcing his dark mana heart to form. After he promised to never force advancements and showed that he was magically fine, she was satisfied. But now he had a question for her. Can a soul be hurt? Dirk asked as Cecilia cooked some food. She stopped when she heard him and looked back at him with worry. He shook his head. My soul is fine. Good. Because any harm that comes to your soul is devastating. 
it inhibits your ability to regenerate mental energy, causes eternal pain, and can impair your ability to control the elements. Well that isn't good. Spite mumbled in Dirk's head. Dirk had lied when he said his soul was fine. It really was injured. So learning this wasn't good news. Is the soul being injured really that bad? Of course. The soul is the deepest essence of every being. It's the foundation for their existence. People with injured souls can be driven to madness and have their minds collapse from the eternal pain, and the lucky ones merely lose their ability to control the elements. Thankfully there aren't many ways a soul can be injured in the first place. But that also means there aren't many ways to heal a soul. I've only heard a few legends of items that can heal or nurture a soul. Oh. Dirk frowned. He didn't think it would be so bad. But it seemed like his injuries were the mildest of mild. Dirk remembered that Eldritch still wanted Dirk's soul, so he couldn't destroy it. At least, the injury he caused Dirk wasn't irreversible. Dirk could also see that it barely affected him at all, merely giving him a dull eternal pain. So he snickered a bit. He can't stop me. He wants me alive and can't kill me while I encroach on his territory. Still, there must be something he can do to take my soul. I can't push my lock. He's likely just as devious as Azura. Baby steps. He nodded as he made his plans. As he got more powerful, he would gradually take more territory. He would stick to the safe route, making stable progress and not making himself vulnerable to surprises. Chapter 103 Apprentice Slash Destruction It was three weeks until the advent of the Dark Dragon. After creating his mana hearts of fire and dark, Dirk spent some time furthering his comprehension of all the runes he'd traced from the original magic texts. With an abundant supply of all his elements, Dirk was able to properly practice spells. He practiced void walking, a spell he used very often in the jungle of death. He pushed himself to understand the complex runes he traced in the void walking book even though it was supposed to be beyond his level. And surprisingly, he was able to comprehend a lot more. The same went for all the other texts. He was able to learn a lot of magical theory about lightning as well as a few powerful spells from the series of lightning book. One was a lightning bolt spell that shocked and scorched enemies with lightning that came from your hands. The other was a spell that could enhance weapons with lightning effects, paralyzing enemies and incinerating their body when hit. Dirk didn't just learn spells from traced runes though. Because he also had his new stigma, he planned to use it correctly. So Dirk worked on creating his own magic. It actually didn't take long for Dirk to learn how to create metal bullets. His enhanced fireball spell was also highly condensed, so after a bit of alteration, Dirk was able to make the projectile speed of the fireball much faster. The same went for the metal bullet where Dirk sacrificed a bit of material strength for much higher speeds. Then Dirk looked toward dark mana. He already knew how to create little clusters of dark mana, so he created a spell that made it into a bullet. Then, Dirk actually learned the runic texts behind Curse of Darkness. Curse of Darkness was a spell one could learn at Tier 3. So Dirk didn't have much trouble learning at all. This was especially so since he recently took over a domain of dark mana. He was able to gain great comprehensions of the element, allowing him to understand the runes much easier. So Dirk applied curses to his bullets. The curses were corrosive ones that would eat away at an opponent's vitality over time, destroying their bodies. With this type of bullet, he could fire a few and then gradually cut his opponent down. It was great for long-term battles. Though, Dirk didn't intend to invest much power into it. Void walking was a more useful application of his limited dark mana. After that, Dirk had three types of bullets, metal, fire, and dark. He tried to make a lightning bullet, but that proved to be extremely difficult. Lightning was too volatile and had little discernible form. Other than that, Dirk focused on one other spell he had in his arsenal. He didn't use it much since its power was limited, but now he intended to fix that. Earthguard was a spell that could create armor out of dirt or rock, guarding a single limb or area of the body. Dirk went ahead and modified it, making the armor metal. 
While metal mana obeyed slightly different rules than standard earth mana, it was still relatively easy to modify the spell. It wasn't long before Dirk was able to generate metal plating over parts of his body. They were solid and powerful, only lesser than properly forged armor. With that, Dirk had the spells he wanted. He then focused on his techniques. Stealth was used to hide. Dirk had made this technique after combining theory, elemental manipulation, and silent spells. It was a complex technique to activate, but worked relatively well when he wasn't up against the jungle of death. It could get past the senses of people at and around his power level. But it wasn't perfect. So Dirk decided to bring the technique to his mother so she could help him refine it. She proved to be a shockingly great help, and he was able to sharpen some things up and make it much easier to use. Then there was Elemental Sonar and Dirk's Mana Vision. His Mana Vision was a work in progress, at least, his Dark Mana Vision was. But even that improved greatly after his recent domain takeover in the Mana Dimension. Dirk was able to form reliable black and white images. For once, he could properly make out faces. He could also see much farther with this black and white vision since it was based on light and brightness, not his general mana sense. As for elemental sonar, Dirk only refined the efficiency and applied some stealth concepts to it, making it more discreet. He was happy with the end result. With that, Dirk had sharpened up all of his magical tools. Next, he took a look at his aura. Aura was an emission of anima beyond the body. Dirk only learned to eject it creating a small outward wave of pure destruction. It wasn't focused in any way and was crude in its usage, so it was only good to supplement punches or kicks. Dirk had used it a few times in the jungle, though he had been more focused on using anima to run and escape. Dirk went to his mother for guidance for this as well, and she was surprised that he was able to create aura at all. He told her that it came naturally with his anima technique after he finished blood destruction, surprising her yet again. Afterward, she showed him the more advanced levels. A pawn class warrior could activate anima in their bodies, strengthening themselves actively. A knight class warrior could emit anima in the form of aura, though only in a crude form like Dirk. A rook class warrior could sharpen and concentrate their aura, using it to enhance their weapons and launch blades of absolute sharpness. Then, there was the bishop class. Dirk was told that bishops could wield their aura in ways that gave rise to magical phenomena. And amazingly, his mother showed him exactly what that meant. Cecilia first showed what an aura blade looked like. A rook was someone who could channel their aura into a weapon without destroying it, instead using the weapon to guide and supplement their aura when destroying something. She told him that a skilled rank 6 or a genius rank 5 warrior could become a rook class. She picked up a kitchen knife, and with a flick, released a void black blade into the air. It dissipated quickly since she hardly infused any power into it. Still, it caught through the air, sending a shiver down Dirk's spine. He couldn't imagine how sharp that blade was. But then, she showed him something amazing. She suddenly started waving the knife around. The tip of the knife drew thin lines in the air that disappeared after a short second. After a few seconds of this, she stopped and reached out her finger. Her finger touched something in the air. It was one of the threads, and it had turned invisible. After flicking the thread though, Dirk saw hundreds of lines of threads momentarily appear all around the room they were in. She had filled the place with a web of death. Dirk froze up, not moving an inch as he felt goosebumps on his neck. Bishop Class Dirk was amazed at this power. Cecilia didn't look like much when she fought Azura since he had absolutely suppressed her, but he was beginning to understand that she was most definitely a monstrous woman. He believed that Azura was her only rival, along with others of his insane level. She could beat anyone else. Go ahead and walk around. Cecilia suddenly spoke to him after he froze up. Gulping in nervousness, he nodded and took a step forward. He felt nothing as he walked through the path of dozens of those strings. It looked like they had disappeared. But they hadn't. Cecilia flicked the string again, and he saw them all reappear. Dirk had walked right through them, and he didn't sense a thing. Yeah, she's a master assassin. 
Dirk couldn't help but smile a bit. His mother was outrageously powerful. It made him happy. After that, Cecilia started to train Dirk on sharpening his aura. He was a rank 4 dash, and she promised that she could make him a rook by rank 5. He smiled at her conviction, and they began a short daily routine of training. Training his magic and body wasn't all Dirk wanted to do though. He remembered a certain someone who had apparently been worried about him. Dirk! You dare disappear while in the middle of lessons? I was teaching you the good stuff. Do you know how much you have to catch up on? You were supposed to be forging with mana crystals long ago. It's nice to see you, Sir Tobastin. Dirk chuckled when he appeared at Forge 8. The dwarf immediately started yelling, but Dirk didn't mind. Tobastin yelled all the time. It was just how he communicated. Seeing Dirk laugh, Tobastin grabbed him by the collar and dragged him inside the forge. We're doing twelve hours today. I hope you haven't been jerking off for the past two and a half years. At least you look a little bigger than before. That means you can hammer more metal. Heh, understood. He laughed as Tobastin threw him his hammer. Dirk was a bit nostalgic before he caught a thrown ingot. And he quickly got to work, Tobastin grilling him with tons of advanced knowledge. He did a short recap on everything they had learned before Dirk disappeared. Then they moved on to the hard stuff. Elemental manipulation, precise metal shaping, infusing elemental power. Tobastin introduced concepts and techniques that Dirk hadn't heard of before, and he was forced to exert lots of energy as he refined his physical and magical control. But Dirk was able to pick up on things shockingly fast. Tobastin was pleasantly surprised. And it wasn't uncalled for. Although Dirk had been through hell, he hadn't been idle. His strength and endurance increased, and his magical prowess jumped significantly just recently. Along with Dirk's natural growth, his overall skill went up. Dirk's muscle memory quickly came back as he moved his body with precision. Of course, there was only so much Tobastin could properly teach in a day, so Dirk wasn't given everything to learn at once. But compared to the past, it was a big leap. By the end of the day, Dirk was breathing fire with every swing of the hammer. Lightning also crackled around his skin. His body was bursting with elemental energy due to his mana hearts, and Tobastin had cheered when he saw Dirk controlling flame like a dragon. Before they knew it, twelve hours passed. Dirk stood straight. His mind was a bit tired from wielding the elements, but his body was bursting with energy. It had vast endurance thanks to his blood destruction and his restoration skill. All right, now go home and digest everything you learned. I expect you back here in the morning. And don't go disappearing again. Don't worry, I won't. And, thanks for continuing to teach me, Sir Tobastin. Sorry for being gone for so long. Please, you think two years is long? I've lived for close to three hundred years. I have no problem waiting a couple more for my genius apprentice to return. Of course. Dirk was stunned by his words for a bit before smiling. So I'm his apprentice now, huh? Dirk bid goodbye as he thought about that. Tobastin had never directly called him his apprentice before. It had always been an unspoken thing between them. He was happy. Magical study, aura practice, and forging. These three things comprised Dirk's schedule. Dirk woke up early to work with his mother and went to Forge 8 for forging lessons. At the end of the day, he would study more traced runes and practice more magic, ending with a tired mind. But there was one more thing Dirk needed to work on. He had completed Section 2 of his Anima Resonance Destruction Technique, Blood Destruction. Now came Section 3. Section 3 required one to resonate and destroy the muscles with Anima. It was as straightforward as the other two sections. This technique really was all about destroying the body and refining it making it stronger. But there was one other detail Dirk learned through the runes in the book. With every step forward, the anima in the body became denser and denser. Likewise, it became more difficult to destroy parts of the body down the line. It required not just more anima, but denser anima. 
so the book called for different items that could be used in the process of resonation and destruction. The items varied greatly, but they could all be summarized. Anything from a living thing that accumulated anima could be used as a source of anima. The bones of monsters, the cores of special trees, exotic fruits, even rare synthetic formations like metal or veins or special rocks. There were all kinds of things that utilized or accumulated anima in this world. In fact, things that accumulated anima were just as prevalent as things that accumulated mana. This could be seen in the amount of mages versus the amount of warriors. Many more people could train anima and not mana. It was also easier to train anima, though only for the low ranks. So finding monsters or other life forms with dense amounts of anima wasn't that difficult. And the book showed Dirk a simple technique to channel anima from other sources and into the body to destroy what he wished. It merely required him to touch the source and absorb it through the porous membrane that was his skin. Skin destruction had precisely prepared him for this. Long story short, Dirk needed dense sources of anima to use. He wouldn't be able to progress anymore without it. His blood destruction had taken a long time since he had been using ambient anima, in fact. It would have gone faster if he had dense anima sources. Luckily, Dirk had rich parents. Upon telling his mother about the next steps he needed to take, she immediately tossed him a bone. A literal bone. It was a human skull, in fact. Dirk was a bit surprised when he caught it. His mother got a bit sheepish. Sorry sweetie, it's the only source of anima I have on me. I'll grab some for you later. Until then, that will act as a great source for anima. It came from a high rank 5. Oh. Thanks. Dirk didn't mind that much. The next moment though, his mother tossed him another object. Since you lost your other one. Dirk caught a small ring out of the air. It was a pocket ring, and when he checked it, he was surprised to see a 100 cubic meter space. It was an absolutely massive space compared to the previous one he had. Dirk smiled. Thanks mom. It's nothing. I would get you an even larger one, but it's not necessary for you right now. Powerful rings can also attract unnecessary attention. Of course. Whatever the explanation, Dirk was happy with it. He slipped it over his index finger where it was most snug, then put the anima skull into it. Since Dirk lived in his parents' house now, there was no need to go home. That night, he pulled out the skull and got comfortable as he recalled the technique to channel anima from a source. He also did a bit of pondering. I should prioritize the muscles I destroy. Start with the important ones. But which one? Dirk went through all the sections of his body. His legs, arms, abdomen, back, neck, and feet. He wondered which one he wanted to become stronger first. I'm already strong everywhere, so there's nothing that's lacking. In that case, it should be something that would give me an edge when fighting. If I assume the worst opponent, then I should prioritize speed over sheer power. So legs will be first. But... I can't immediately strengthen the biggest muscles. I should reinforce the flexors and mobility muscles. In that case, let's start with my hips. Then I can do my knees. And then my calves and ankles. Then I can do the quads and glutes and hamstrings. Then I'll need to do my core for stability. Yes, let's start with that. Dirk quickly made an ordered list. And with the decision made, he started with his right leg. He targeted the right hip flexors, the muscles that allowed the leg to raise and gave it some horizontal mobility. Dirk didn't want to target the largest muscles and then create strength imbalances or even harm himself. He prioritized stable and gradual strengthening, not sudden and erratic. Of course, his strengthening wouldn't happen immediately. It would be a long process to destroy every muscle group in his body. Or will it? Dirk suddenly questioned that. He had his new restoration skill that repaired his body. With it, he could heal faster and destroy things faster. Just destroy the muscle already and then we'll know. Alright then. Dirk shrugged after hearing spite before channeling anima out of the skull. He placed it against his leg and absorbed it through the skin. Then, 
he concentrated it before resonating it. Dirk felt as his muscles were destroyed by the cell. It was like the anima was burning his muscle alive. The pain was much greater than blood destruction. But Dirk didn't so much as frown. He was merely curious as he felt the muscles weaken greatly. He also noticed how much of the anima he resonated dissipated during the process. Dirk wasn't sure if this was due to a lack of skill or if it was natural. Either way, when he hit a certain level of destruction, he stopped. Standing up, Dirk could barely lift his knee with weakness. So my muscle isn't totally immobilized, just really weak. That's good to know. How's the healing? Give me a minute. Spite mumbled as she observed his body. The nanites flooded to the muscle, and his skill kicked in. Cells began to naturally regenerate and rebuild the muscle with surprising speed. His mana also vitalized the destroyed muscle, giving it more strength despite nearly half of it being obliterated. Dirk felt all the food he ate from dinner be burned for fuel. His heart pumped nutrients through his bloodstream, his nanites following along to increase the throughput of essential supplies. He decided to grab more food as his fuel was burned. After cooking himself a large slab of meat, he ate as the muscle continued to rebuild. It was almost half an hour later when Spike came back with a report. The muscle should be completely rebuilt and fully functional in 14 hours. Really? That's nice. Question is though, how much progress does each destruction cycle give me? Dirk asked the most important question. He might heal fast, but if the muscles didn't regenerate with a lot of anima, it would take a lot of destruction cycles to complete a single muscle. We can only wait and see. True. Then let's hurry up and sleep. Dirk spoke before finishing up his midnight dinner and going to bed. He slept with a bit of excitement that night. Chapter 104 Airship Slash Dark Kingdom One week until the advent of the Dark Dragon. For the past two weeks, Dirk stuck to his schedule, and his skills improved in every way. He grew into the accumulated elemental comprehensions bringing his power to another level. His main focus though was on his muscle destruction. After two weeks, Dirk was able to completely destroy and refine his hip flexor. But he was not happy about that time frame. Too long. A single muscle took two weeks. I destroyed it every day. Two solutions. Spite chimed in as he frowned. You can either increase the amount of muscle you destroy every cycle, or you can destroy the muscle more thoroughly. You only destroyed about half of it each cycle. You could destroy up to 75% and be safe. There's a downside though. You wouldn't be able to use the muscle at all while it heals. 15 hours of healing may not be a lot, but in enemy territory, you need to keep your weakness to a minimum. I suggest the first option. I agree. Dirk nodded after giving it some thought. He wouldn't like not being able to use his muscles at all after destroying them. Depending on the muscle, he would have a hard time just going about daily life. At least if he did things normally he would retain some function, however weak. So let's destroy more at a time. You can do it by muscle groups. I've categorized 13 that cover all sections of the body from your chest to your calves. If each group takes two weeks to fully destroy and refine, then that would be 26 weeks of daily destructions, or half a year. What if I tried to destroy them all? Instead of going by muscle groups, I could do full body destruction cycles. In theory, it would only take two weeks to complete muscle destruction. That would be hard for your restoration skill to handle. Recovery would take much longer. You would also need an ample anima supply. And then there's the issue of properly refining the muscles. There might not be enough anima to go around if everything is recovering, leading to lesser results upon healing. So in actual theory, it would likely take much longer than two weeks, and you would remain in a bed for all hours of every day. Could I at least try? Ask your mother first. Fine. Giving in, Dirk went and found his mother. She was a powerful warrior, so she knew all about body refining. Absolutely not. And she didn't like Dirk's idea. You know there is such thing as anima overload, right? 
Just like you can strain yourself with mana accumulation, you can potentially permanently harm your body if you overdo the refining. Body refining is a gradual process that your body must adapt alongside, steadily bringing it to a higher level. It's not just a matter of shoving anima inside yourself and expecting to get stronger. That's how you cripple yourself for life. And no, your restoration skill wouldn't be able to heal from it. If you cripple yourself with anima, it's absolutely permanent unless healed by an extremely strong anima potion. Do you understand? Yes, mother. Good. Never attempt something like that. And thank you for coming to me first. Please do so when you have more crazy ideas like that. Spite, you'll be in charge of reminding him and alerting me. I understand. Mm, love you. Cecilia smiled and kissed Dirk on the forehead after the cat nodded from his shoulder. Dirk sighed inwardly. Well, six months it is then. That's already moving plenty fast. You'll be fine. Besides, I wouldn't wish to serve a crippled master. Did you just call me master? No. You did. Well, I guess you were my underling. Dirk scratched his chin with a smile, stopping when Spite pawed his face. I am not. I'm a part of you. We're equals. You were created from my soul. So I was birthed from you. Are you my father? Should I call you daddy? Please don't. Dirk's eye twitched. Spite seemed to enjoy his shame. Well, I guess you being my father is giving you too much credit. You do give me energy though, so you're like a sugar daddy. Stop. You're right. Just daddy is fine. What's the matter? Don't like it? You will become a tattoo before I hear any more of that. Fine. You're no fun. Spite finally huffed. She liked her cat form and its freedom. Not being able to explore and operate a body was boring. Thankful that he shut that down, Dirk moved on with his life. Three days until the advent of the Dark Dragon. Dirk had thought that his mother would bring him out to hunt any Azura assassins before this big outing, but since he had such a busy schedule with forging and all, she just let him be. It wasn't a bad thing to accumulate much needed power anyway. And before Dirk knew it, the time for the holiday came. It was at this time that Riker finally appeared. He had been gone with work all the time. Being an envoy, especially one at his level, wasn't an easy responsibility to handle. His voice was now that of the Empire's. We're going to leave for a frontier city tomorrow night. We'll take a teleporter there and then embark for the capital of the Dark Kingdom. We should arrive by midday the next day. After that, we hold some preliminary discussions and get ready for the holiday. We'll be participating in it alongside the royalty there. We need to bring dresses? No. It'll supposedly be prepared for us. I would bring at least one set just in case though. Of course. Cecilia nodded at her husband's words. Dirk just ate the dinner in front of him. He was hungry from all the healing his body was doing. Seeing this, Cecilia was both happy and worried. Dirk had refused to drink so much as a drop of potion. She left it out for him, but it went untouched for the weeks that he was doing destruction cycles. She knew he could handle the healing just fine, but she wanted to ease the burden on his body. But she knew he was tough, so she didn't insist. She trusted in his judgment and didn't want to force him to do something that might bring back bad memories. After that night, Dirk spent one more day in the capital. He was a bit more relaxed as he just focused on forging. He also told Tobastin that he would be leaving. Because of that, the dwarf pushed him harder that day. Come night, Dirk cleaned up before he was called by his mother. Having already prepared, he went down with the clothes on his back and pocket ring filled with items. Before they left though, Cecilia grabbed his attention. Two things. She suddenly held up both her hands. In one was a necklace made of two black metal strands that were twisted together, holding a crystal pendant at the bottom. In the other was a weapon, a long knife that was almost a short sword. The necklace has defensive magic as well as an alert beacon. You can also use it to send me messages after infusing your dark mana and speaking into it. 
This knife is an enchanted weapon. It's designed to channel your aura. Technically you can only channel aura into weapons when you're a rook class, but enchanted animal weapons like this bypass the skill restriction and do it for you. In exchange, it's not compatible with mana. But you have your stigma, so that shouldn't be an issue. With this, you have your strengths boosted. Thank you, mother. Dirk nodded pleasantly as he took the knife. Cecilia also put the necklace on him. The cold metal warmed on his body. Let's go then. With that, the two left the house and made their way to the city's teleportation platform. There, Riker was waiting, along with a small group of people. There were three men and two women. Two of the men and both the women didn't have much power in them, being as strong as or weaker than Dirk. The third man though caused Dirk to narrow his eyes. He couldn't sense much of anything. He looked ordinary besides the luxurious clothes. But Dirk's hair stood on end. His gut was telling him to not believe the lack of power. The man also looked at Dirk after greeting Cecilia. He smiled, exposing two long and sharp fangs. So you're Dirk? I've heard a lot about you. You really do have sharp senses. Dirk, this is Marquis Desmodius. Riker suddenly introduced the man. Hearing the name, Dirk tilted his head. Desmodius. He's Alec's father. Dirk's eyebrows raised. He then smiled when he saw a figure approaching. Dirk! Dirk turned his body, sensing a man flowing with a magnificently bright presence. In Dirk's mana sense, he drove away darkness and purified his surroundings with divine light. It was Alec, a fire and light mage with sky-high charisma. Hello Alec. That's a bland greeting. I haven't seen you in years. Come here, guy. Alec put out his hand. Dirk smacked it with his own and went in for a hug. They pat each other on the back, a truly manly greeting. Dirk smiled. The two hadn't been super close, but it didn't seem like Alec cared. He was happy to see a friend. Sheesh, I had worked hard and formed a party that could keep up with you, and then you go and vanish. We're going on a trip now though, so maybe I can get a taste of your current power. Who knows, maybe I've become stronger than you. Heh, <sighs> we'll have to fight and see. Dirk chuckled as he looked at Alec. Like Dirk, he had grown a lot. He was actually an inch or so taller, his golden hair flowing down to his broad shoulders. His muscles were also a bit more pronounced, not as compact and lean as Dirk's, so he was definitely containing a lot of power. He looked like a grown man if one looked past the youthful face. And it looked like he was at least tier 4, if not tier 5 with how bright his mana was. Puberty hit everyone like a truck, huh? Dirk laughed, and the two talked a bit more. The others in the group lingered around for a while. Then, the teleportation platform suddenly glowed. A man appeared, bristling with an aura of sheathed violence. He looked mean and stern, gazing at everyone with narrowed eyes. Duke Kyer, known as the Bloody Sword of the Empire and the highest general under the Emperor. He's as ruthless as he is wise, and he holds vast authority. There weren't any others who held more power than him under the Emperor. He stood taller than all others in the group, being nearly seven feet tall. His black and red robes radiated in position as if demanding all others obey his every command. Still, his sharply cut beard and hair made him look valiant. To have this man stand beside you on a battlefield would inspire undying bravery. Are we all here? Then let's go. Duke Kyer activated the teleporter with a deep voice. With his word, everyone stepped forward. Within moments, they vanished. The next thing Dirk knew, he was inside a large stone building. Everyone walked out, and they appeared within a city. The frontier city of Brazer, a city similar to that of Calaba which occupied land along the border. Only, because the Empire was much less friendly with the Dark Kingdom than the Dwarven Haven, this city was fully outfitted for war at all times, maintaining a huge standing army. This was especially so right now. Citizens and soldiers alike were moving with haste. Two armies were in a stalemate not far from here, so they had to be on high alert. Duke Kyer led them through the city, 
and every soldier bowed in reverence as he passed. Dirk felt a bit weird. He was walking with really high-profile people. He could be considered one of them as the son of a Marquis. His status was showing its benefits. It wasn't long before the group approached a huge raised platform. Dirk almost tripped when he saw what was on the platform. There's the airship. Alec mumbled. Standing at 120 meters long and 20 meters tall, an airship glowed with enchantments, air mana, and even some dark mana. There were no sails or anything of the like, and the ship looked shockingly similar to a modern plane from Earth with wings and fins. It was only a bit larger and bulkier. Curiously, the body of the airship looked like it was made from some kind of crystalline material. The body was sky blue in color, seemingly constructed from opaque fragile glass. Alex spoke as the group boarded this ship, entering its large body. This ship is made almost entirely from aerolite. As an air element metal, aerolite is both strong and light, allowing the mana engine of this thing to lift such a large ship off the ground. It's also fully compatible with the air element, allowing it to fly through the sky at high speeds. Of course, it's an extremely expensive item, and there aren't a whole lot of these in the Empire. Dirk took in the sights around him. Since his dark mana vision had improved greatly, he could make out black and white images, albeit not perfectly. It still gave him a good look at the corridors, machines, and people they passed while walking through the ship. They quickly arrived at the bridge of the airship. There was already a man waiting, and he saluted Duke Kyer. Leave when ready. Understood, General. Commencing takeoff in five minutes. Dirk felt the man around him fluctuate. Although he wasn't attuned to air mana, he could still sense its wild movement. Then, several minutes later after strapping into a seat, Dirk felt the ship lift off the ground. It gradually flew upward, then leaning forward as the captain increased the speed. They rapidly flew off as Dirk was pushed back into his seat, air mana streaming past the wings as if there were invisible thrusters on them. 30, 60, 100, 180, 250, 340, 420. Spike gauged the speed based on the G-force Dirk was experiencing. He was shocked at the numbers. Finally, they settled at around 510 miles per hour. There was a tiny amount of turbulence as they flew, but nothing that shook the ship. Dirk felt weird as he sat in his seat. Do a halo jump out of the side door. No thanks. I don't have a parachute. Maybe when you finish muscle destruction, you can survive terminal velocity falls with your body. Maybe. Dirk smiled a bit as he looked out the window. He could make out vague images of the landscape. Of course, everything was dark, so there wasn't much to see. With that, everyone just had to wait. Their destination was the capital of the Dark Kingdom. Dirk laid his head back to rest, wondering what the place would look like. After the sun rose over the horizon, Dirk felt the airship jolt a bit. They were slowing down. We're making our approach. You should see it. Alec came over as Dirk woke up. Because he had a cloth covering his eyes, nobody could be sure when he was sleeping. Dirk looked like he had been awake for a while when he nodded and walked to the bridge. There, he was able to get a bird's eye view of the capital. Only, when he did, he recoiled in shock. There was a hole. A massive hole that was six entire miles wide. There was a large city built on the land around the hole, and a city floating above the hole. A city around five miles wide was floating above this colossal hole in the ground. From this massive city rose hundreds and thousands of buildings that extended hundreds of meters into the air. There was a tower in the center of this floating city that stood above all, one that rose 1,000 meters in the air, piercing above the clouds. It was blood red in color, looking like a needle. Dirk was baffled by this city that floated above an abyssal pit in the ground that seemed to have no end to its depth. There were also ten bridges that extended across the mile-long gap between the edge of the hole and the city. The airship lowered itself to land near one of these ten bridges. Dirk also saw three utterly massive chains that extended from the thick city platform and anchored it to the walls of the hole, as if to keep it from drifting around. 
but the floating city wasn't the main reason why Dirk had a violent reaction. The reason for his reaction was due to the horrifying amount of dark mana that bellowed out of the bottomless pit, making it seem like the gateway to hell itself. Luckily, due to the insane amount of dark mana, he could see everything around the hole with shocking clarity using his dark mana sense. Even from so far away, he could see all the short and tall buildings in the floating city. He felt nice, getting such a clear view. The airship quickly descended onto a large platform, docking on the hard ground with extended legs. All the soldiers within the ship marched out in formation, placing themselves between the ship and the Dark Kingdom soldiers that were waiting for them. Then, Duke Kyer stepped out, along with the two Marquises and the delegates. Dirk and Alec walked beside their parents. Dirk could feel Alec's nervousness as he felt the tense atmosphere between the soldiers. A man standing in front of the Dark Kingdom soldiers looked at Duke Kyer with a smile. He radiated a no less imposing atmosphere than Kyer, though he was shorter so people couldn't help but compare. That person is definitely powerful. Probably as much as the Duke. Dirk thought as the man spoke. General Kyer. Her Majesty welcomes you to our Dark Kingdom. General Salas. It's been fifty years. I'm glad our meeting isn't happening on one of those bridges like before. H.M. General Salas merely let out a humph. His momentary frown only remained for short though as he waved his arm. Allow me to escort you. We have residences prepared for all our honored guests as well as quarters prepared in the outer city for your soldiers. Appreciated. Kyer nodded and walked beside General Salas. The others followed as they went to cross the bridge while the soldiers handled themselves under the directive of a captain. A large carriage was prepared, and the group boarded at the behest of General Salas. Like that, they rode across the mile-long bridge. Dirk looked at the abyssal hole under the bridge, feeling a bit queasy at the supernatural formation. They rode into the so-called inner city, otherwise known as the floating city and true capital of the Dark Kingdom. It was completely filled with tall and high-class buildings, and excited people walked the streets making preparations for the coming holiday. The entire place radiated wealth, and despite being called the Dark Kingdom, the city was vibrant with plant life and even native animals. The atmosphere wasn't dreary in the slightest. Dirk was shocked when he even saw mechanical machines in some of the shops and buildings. It seemed almost out of place, the modern hardware that Dirk only knew to exist on Earth. They rode all the way to the massive spire in the center of the city. It was there that they exited the carriage and were led inside. Ascending the tower was done by magic elevators, all of which used dark magic in its spatial aspect. Cecilia didn't seem that surprised by it as if she had experience, but she was still impressed. Gravity magic. Always amazes me. Indeed. Nowhere in the world will you find greater applications of dark magic or smarter practitioners. Hmm. Cecilia didn't deny General Salas's comment. That was a generally agreed-upon fact. The Horizon Empire surely didn't have anything like this. In fact, Dirk was beginning to think that the Horizon Empire was primitive compared to this place. They were on a floating city. Dirk had never seen such fantastical structures in either of his lives. As they rose in the elevator though, Dirk suddenly started to frown. He noticed an odd feeling coming from his soul. It wasn't the eternal pain due to his soul injury. It was something else. Something, familiar, yet foreign. He got a bit restless as they stopped on a particular floor. Chapter 105, Vampire All the honored guests were shown to their temporary residences. Cecilia and Riker, Dirk, Alec and his father, Duke Kyer, and four other delegates. Ten people who represented the Horizon Empire. After being shown to their residences, it was everyone except Dirk, Cecilia, and Alec who left with General Salas. Since they were here, the envoys had no time to waste. Their discussions that would determine the outbreak of war took precedence over any kind of leisure activity or sightseeing. But that didn't concern the three who were left behind. After Cecilia had Alec join her and Dirk, the three left the spire and roamed the city. 
there were all kinds of preparations being made around the capital city. Decorations and lights were strung up across the buildings, and odd magical objects were scattered across the streets and rooftops. There were also children who held black dragon props that ran through the sidewalks, roaring with childish laughter. Vendors were hawking various wares, most of which were food for the hungry workers. There were also little trinkets, jewelry, and fireworks. Wait, fireworks. Dirk stopped in his tracks when he saw a certain booth. They sold boxes filled with flares and Roman missiles. They were fireworks, and they looked too much like what Dirk remembered from Earth. Even the word firework was directly translated to this world's language. There was one other detail he noticed. It was a name that branded the fireworks. As he walked down the street, Dirk had also paid close attention to the machines. They all had a small brand on them. Pandora. He mumbled the name. He wondered who that was. They seemed to be some kind of scientist. At some point in his staring, Alec came up to him. He only glanced at the fireworks before looking around at the surrounding city. My dad is a vampire. He suddenly spoke, and Dirk turned his head. He was only a bit surprised as he remembered the sharp teeth Alec's father exposed while smiling. He even noticed Alec's teeth. They weren't as long, but those canines were definitely sharp. He hadn't seen that a couple of years ago when they were younger. Are you a vampire then? Not purely, but yes. My father says I'm around a quarter vampire. And since my mother is human, I'm majority human. Dirk nodded. The Dark Kingdom. Unlike the Horizon Empire that was dominated by humans, this kingdom was dominated by vampires. Vampires were known for their strong affinity toward the dark element. Likewise, humans had a stronger affinity toward the fire element. Dwarves from the Dwarven Haven had a stronger affinity toward the Earth, Elves from the World Tree had a stronger affinity toward air, and Hybrids from the Unity Empire had a stronger affinity toward water. The World Tree was actually located in the south and southwestern section of the world underneath the Dark Kingdom who was in the direct west. The World Tree was also detached from the Hybrid Empire Unity that occupied the east, separated by a significant distance. Thus it was the Dark Kingdom's vampires that frequently traded with the elves of the World Tree. The two were almost exclusive partners and had a deep commercial and diplomatic bond. It was also why many vampires walking the streets of the city had pointed ears. It was because elves and vampires frequently mated, producing a large mixed population. Though, pure vampires were still the majority in the Dark Kingdom, especially in the capital city. Dirk suddenly asked a question that came to mind. So, since you've got vampire blood, what do you do about, well, blood? Vampires, as their name implied, enjoyed the delicacy that was blood. It was a big reason why the Horizon Empire and the Dark Kingdom didn't have a good relationship, though the main reason was still the wars they fought against each other. Alec answered plainly. There's usually blood in the food I eat. It's not essential though. Even pure vampires like my dad don't absolutely need to intake blood. But he frequently drinks it. There are plenty of strong monsters to obtain blood from, and he's got the money. Sure. But then why is blood important to you guys? It's like a power booster. Alec gave an interesting answer. When a vampire drinks blood, their body is able to steal the blood's vitality. Blood is the medium by which everyone's vital energy is transported. Take the blood, and you take the vitality. Vampires then make it their own. For vampires who train anima, we preferably use powerful blood and bone marrow to enhance our bodies. Normally though, drinking blood can temporarily increase a vampire's power and energy, also giving them greater healing capabilities. It can also replace other forms of sustenance. Because of this, you'll find something called blood potions here. They're potions made with blood as the primary ingredient. They even work on humans, though with lesser effects. Interesting. How much is your power boosted when you drink blood? Depends on the blood, but not by much. If the blood came from a high-tier monster, then it usually gives greater magical abilities. If it came from an anima monster, then it'll increase physical prowess. 
And, the stronger the blood, the better it tastes, and the better it makes our bodies feel. It simply fills our body with vitality, and everyone likes that. Interesting. Your blood should taste fantastic in that case. Spite chuckled a bit, causing Dirk to smirk. Dirk had gone through blood destruction and his mana hearts pumped mana into his bloodstream. There was also that enhancement with Master Xing's experimental potion, replacing Dirk's human blood with something else similar to a dragon's. His blood had been strengthened several times over. Thinking that, Dirk made sure never to let a vampire taste his blood. They might want all of it. So do you only get blood from monsters or do you prefer human blood? That's a dangerous question. Why? It's a taboo subject. I've never actually had human blood before, and my father has made me promise never to drink any, not that I want to. To many humans, vampires are parasites, so he always tried to make sure that we weren't seen that way. Though, that's also the reason he's a Marquis. Should he be a higher noble? He's a rank 8, so he should be a duke. Wow. Dirk couldn't help his surprise. He didn't realize that Alec's father was so strong. Could he go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Azura? Alex sighed. But because it's a human empire, there are many who don't like him, and he can't become a duke. I thought power was supposed to surpass the words of the weak. It does, but being a duke in the Horizon Empire means more than just being a high noble. It's a major position of power that makes you a pillar of the empire, one of its greatest protectors. It's unfortunate, but one's race can't be ignored when making someone a pillar. Still, my father and the emperor have a great standing with each other. It's just unsuitable for my father to become a duke, and he's never pushed for the position on purpose. Instead, the two cooperate commercially. My father controls a major portion of the empire's industry. He also does things like this. Being an envoy? Yes. Alec nodded with a faint smile, proud of his father's strength and achievements. Dirk was confused though. Why does your father do it though? He could come here and be a pillar of the Dark Kingdom. I'm not exactly sure why. I've asked him the same thing. He tells me that his allegiance lies with the Horizon Empire, or more specifically, Emperor Horizon. The two cooperate a lot, so I guess they're friends. Wow. Even though you're not the son of a duke, you're still a serious Crystal Spoon noble. Indeed. It's a very lavish lifestyle. I enjoy it whenever I can. Heh. <laughs> Dirk chuckled as Alec shamelessly agreed. Still, Dirk found Alec's father's position interesting. A vampire who was friends with the emperor and swore allegiance to a human empire. Now, he was here negotiating with vampires on behalf of the humans. It was odd. By the way. I've heard some interesting things about the royalty here. Like? Dirk listened in when Alec changed topics. He pointed to the logo on the fireworks. That name, Pandora. Apparently she's a princess, the third child and daughter of the Vampire Queen. She's become famous in recent years, but I guess she's always been a bit peculiar. My father says that she's one of the reasons for the recent big shift in the Dark Kingdom's standing. She's also supposed to be our age. Someone our age is shifting an entire empire's political and military stance. She sounds dangerous. And impressive. That too. Why can't you do that? How would I? I can't even think of something I could do to cause such change. And I don't have the ability to do anything revolutionary. Alec shrugged his shoulders as the two walked. Dirk smiled a bit, the two bouncing between topics as they wandered the city. All they could do is wander though. Since the Horizon Empire and the Dark Kingdom might be going to war soon, the Horizon currency was worthless in this place. They couldn't buy food or items for the upcoming festival. But they didn't need to either. After Cecilia met back up with them, they all returned to the spire. There, they got some room service and were able to be served food. After that, they spent the rest of the day hanging around. Dirk found himself looking out his window and at the surrounding city. He worked on sharpening his long-distance black and white vision. It got better by the day. 
Come night though, Dirk was greeted by a maid. She requested that they do a clothing selection for the next day. He didn't mind and a whole group of people came in with racks of clothes. All the clothes were luxurious, and it didn't seem like the Dark Kingdom intended to embarrass their guests with a bad selection. The four women all looked at Dirk and took in his shape and stature before grabbing vests, blazers, pants, shoes, shirts, and even hats to try on. Dirk quickly became a dress-up doll as they sought to make him look perfect. Handsome, sharp, and elusive. This was how they described his look, and they giggled whenever they made adjustments and took in his entire form. Dirk just smiled as they had their fun. He followed along and changed into whatever they wanted. He also chuckled when they went to remove his blindfold only to see the cursed cracks and put it back in apology. Sometimes Dirk looked in the mirror and was impressed as he got glimpses of his own look with his sharpening black and white vision. Dirk didn't dress up at all, so this was a nice change in pace. But the women were good at their job, and as women themselves, they knew what they liked. They made adjustments and Dirk was surprised as his look became more refined. Tight clothes that showed off his muscles, but also made him seem a bit loose and free. After two hours of playing dress up, they made a decision. Black pants, black shirt, and a dark red vest that had intricate black designs on it. After leaving some of his chest exposed with the shirt, they trimmed his hair a bit and combed it back. As for Dirk's skin, it was perfect from skin destruction, so there was no makeup or blemish hiding they needed to do. Slipping on a pair of black shoes and rolling up the sleeves, the women took a step back. There wasn't a lot on Dirk, just his clothes, but he looked sharper than ever. As they said, less is more. They even swapped the blindfold for something nicer than a torn piece of cloth. The four were satisfied, and after stripping off the clothes, they promised to be back tomorrow afternoon before the ball started. Dirk was a bit surprised as they walked out. And as they left, Cecilia walked in. She watched the four women exit before looking at Dirk's combed back hair. Your hair looks good. Thanks. Did you like how they dressed you? I was dressed up rather nicely considering the tensions between our empires. I liked it. I've never looked so proper before. Dirk smiled while taking a seat. H.M., I wish I saw it before they left. Oh well, it'll be a nice surprise. Anyway, we have something we need to do. I've never actually taught you this, and it's last minute, but I'm sure you'll do fine. Cecilia walked over as she said that, standing in front of Dirk. You heard about the ball? Yes. Do you know what people do at a ball? No. Dirk answered honestly. Not in his past life or this one had he ever participated in a ball. He had no idea what people did there. Everyone who will be at this ball are the highest echelons of the Dark Kingdom. Royalty, politicians, dukes, generals, merchants, artisans, and the most powerful individuals this empire can muster. Disregarding why we're here, there's usually three things everyone does when in the presence of such powerful people. They network, they drink, and they dance. You won't be doing the first thing, so you'll need to learn how to do the other two. I need to learn how to drink. People criticize everything, Dirk. From your walk, to your voice, to the way you sit. For royalty, Everything must be refined, even the way they hold cups in their hands and how much they sip at a time with each tilt of the glass. I'll teach you how to carry yourself with manners in such a setting. But first, you need to learn to dance. Okay. But who would I be dancing with? I know nobody here. Oh, you innocent child. I'm glad you're not so self-aware of your devilish looks. Cecilia ruffled his hair with a smile. Dirk tilted his head. Innocent? He was the farthest thing from naive and innocent. From his perspective, of course. Dirk, you're at a ball where all the teenagers your age are looking to enjoy their night. Girls are going to find the cutest or hottest man, so any girl that wants to dance with you is going to do so because she's interested in you. Now, a romantic interest doesn't mean they hope to marry you. They just want to take you to bed for the night. And because of that, I want you to reject all the girls you dance with. Nothing goes beyond the dance floor. Understood? 
All right? Dirk nodded oddly. Cecilia smiled as she tapped his nose. Anyway, I still need to teach you how to dance, since you will be dancing. Will I? It's basically guaranteed. Anyway, sharpen up, pretty boy. Keep up and I'll teach you the steps as we go. The manners can come later. Saying that, Cecilia grabbed Dirk's hands and started leading. Dirk fumbled around for a bit before catching her rhythm. After that, he stepped as he was told, learning the moves of the dance. This dancing lesson lasted well into the night. Cecilia had fun as Dirk caught on quick, the two moving faster and faster as she challenged his footwork. It was only when Riker arrived that the two eventually stopped. He smiled as he saw his son learning to dance and having fun, but unfortunately he wasn't in a position to just sit back and enjoy a show. Cecilia, we need to talk. Hmm. I'll teach you manners tomorrow then, Dirk. Teach Dirk manners? I personally feel a bit of rugged etiquette has its own charm. It's not good to be so uptight and stiff all the time. You just get shaky when you're nervous, honey. I spilled my drink once, dear. And I thought it was cute. Cecilia chuckled as she pat Riker's cheek, the two leaving Dirk's room. Dirk had a weird smile before getting ready for bed. Chapter 106, Ballroom Slash Queen The next morning, the city was immediately lively. It only got more festive as the afternoon came. Alec grabbed Dirk to wander the streets when the sun was high in the sky. When they did, they were surprised to see all kinds of little magic devices flying around above and between the buildings. They occasionally flashed with lights of various colors, looking like drones. There was another thing Dirk noticed when he stepped out of the spire. He seemed lighter. It was the dark mana being emitted from the abyss below the city. Dirk could feel it suspend his body just a little bit. And it seemed to get stronger throughout the day. Even little kids began jumping higher than their own height. It was a bit disorienting. But it was cool, nonetheless. It was a supernatural phenomenon happening across the city. The city itself was beyond comprehension, able to float above a bottomless hole in the ground. Dirk found it exhilarating. It was only a few hours after noon that the two headed back. They had to get ready for the ball. The ball actually started an hour before the sun set. But there were many things to do beforehand. Women had to beautify, men had to hold discussions, butlers and maids had to make sure that everything was in order. Anybody that couldn't be found several hours before the event would throw off routine. So in actuality, getting ready for the ball was an all-day process. For most of the nobles, anyway. Dirk and Alec didn't have much of a part to play except to look pretty, so they only had to be at their rooms at a certain time. From there, maids would take care of them. And they were taken care of, though perhaps a bit more than Dirk would have liked. He had thought that they would just come and address him, maybe clean up his hair before sending him on his way. But apparently bathing was a meticulous process that required the skills of practiced maids. After Dirk got into the bath by himself, he was intruded upon by two ladies with special soaps. After Dirk stopped one of them from scrubbing his every nook and cranny, and after they emphasized the importance of making sure he was perfectly clean, they compromised and Dirk let them clean everything from his waist up and he had to admit, getting his hair and back scrubbed at the same time by two women was heavenly. Because his eyes were already sealed shut, he felt every little brush of their fingers in the pleasing massage as they lathered his arms and shoulders. He was grateful for his heightened sense of touch that amplified the feeling. But he was also a bit ashamed to have enjoyed it as much as he did. Spite, who was sitting in her cat form nearby, snickered at him with her eyes. Still, he let them do their thing for over an hour, disregarding the faint suspicion that the maids were enjoying it just as much. It was when a couple other maids came into the room that Dirk was able to get out of the bath. After drying off, he was hounded as they got him ready to dress. This took another hour. They combed and sharpened up his hair, put on the predetermined outfit, and straightened him out. They were also going to apply a cologne but after smelling the aroma Dirk naturally released, they decided not to. They knew that powerful people, especially body refiners, wouldn't sweat or get dirty like ordinary people. 
there was no need to solve a problem that wasn't there. With a touch of lotion and a tug of the collar, Dirk was finally ready. By this time, the sun was beginning to make its descent. From so far above the city within the spire, Dirk could see lights begin to flick on in buildings and among magical devices. Not only that, but the dark mana that came out of the abyss below the city got a bit stronger. Dirk naturally felt light, each of his casual steps able to make him float in the air for a second. Dirk was eventually guided by a made up the spire where he was put into a particular room. Inside this room was Alec waiting by himself. Spite jumped on Dirk's shoulder as he walked in. Alec glanced at the cat smiling at Dirk. Dirk! You look good! You too! The two smiled at each other as they observed the clothes they were provided with. Dirk's clothes were black and dark red, and Alec's were white and a brighter red. His clothes accentuated his blonde hair and valiant character. He was bright, and Dirk was dark. It matched their types well. After they smacked their hands together in greeting, Dirk asked the question. So did you get washed by the maids here too? Washed by the maids? Like, during your bath? Yeah. The hell? No, I didn't get washed by maids. Are you saying you did? Yeah. Two of them came in after I hopped in the bath and cleaned my upper body. They said they had to make sure I properly cleaned up and everything. They even had special soaps. Wah. No. I didn't get anything like that. After Alec raised his voice with narrowed eyes, Dirk's face darkened slightly. So getting washed by maids isn't normal? Hell no. You just got taken advantage of. Those scheming foxes tricked you. He he he. That was a nice scheme. Sign me up for another. Shut up, you lucky bastard. Alec spat as Dirk chuckled shamelessly. Compared to all the other schemes he was a victim of, Dirk welcomed this one with open arms. After Alec bickered with Dirk some more, other people began to arrive. First was Alec's father, then Dirk's parents followed by the other delegates. They all appeared dressed in primary black and white colors with red accents. Dirk was a bit enraptured when his parents walked in. Riker entered while linked arms with his wife. He was dressed in a maroon red tailcoat suit with black designs across it. The designs fluctuated with the fire element, making them glow with dark heat and Dirk's mana vision. It looked truly noble from his perspective. It was the same with Cecilia. She came in with a similarly colored maroon red dress that accentuated her curves while maintaining some modesty. One of her long legs was exposed as she walked alongside her husband. The two looked like the perfect couple. Cecilia's eyes lit up when she saw Dirk. He stood tall as his black and blood-red clothes did nothing to hide his lean but chiseled build. Along with his combed back hair, sharp jaw, and blindfolded eyes, he looked dark and mysterious. Such a handsome child. They truly did do justice. I've never seen you look so sharp. Thanks, Mom. Dirk smiled as Cecilia tiptoed and kissed his forehead. Afterward, she placed her hands on the sides of his face, her thumbs brushing over his blindfold. She adjusted it a bit with a neutral face. How is it? Fine. It doesn't hurt. That's good. Can you see me? Yeah. Dirk nodded after a second. His black and white vision was getting better, and he had told his mother about it. Unfortunately, there wasn't much she could do to help him. Seeing purely through mana wasn't easy or a widely known concept. Dirk was pioneering his own path through this. But there was one thing she started doing. Since Dirk could see mana, Cecilia started to cover her body with a light film of dark mana, allowing Dirk to clearly see her. That way, unlike all the other obscure figures he saw through fire mana and body heat or skin through earth mana, she stood out and could more easily interact with him. It was comforting. Duke Kyer. Alec's father suddenly spoke as another man came walking in. It was Duke Kyer, and he was dressed in a black suit, on which were deep orange designs seemingly made of fire. These designs connected with a symbol on his chest, that of the Horizon Empire. 
After he walked in, Riker and Alec's father went over to talk, forming a small group. Like that, everyone lingered around as they waited. Dirk guessed this was like some kind of staging before the event. And sure enough, a maid came to get them when the sun began to touch dip below the horizon. Envoys of the Horizon Empire. Please follow me. The maid was respectful as she bowed and led them. Duke Kyer took the lead, and everyone left the room. After walking down a few ornate hallways, they came upon a large set of doors. They were already open, and there were people inside the ballroom seated around various tables. Most of the tables were empty. Duke Kyer and the envoys of the Horizon Empire have arrived. At the announcement, everyone in the ballroom turned to the doors. Duke Kyer walked in imposingly as if he owned the place. The two Marquises behind him also stood tall. Riker especially as he escorted his wife. When Dirk entered, he sensed the surroundings. And he was shocked as he sensed four people with fathomless auras surrounding them. Dirk's man of vision was blurred when he focused on them. Dukes of the Dark Kingdom. The only ones who had the same aura as them were Duke Kyer and Alec's father. Being outnumbered like this, they were treading right into a lion's den. But they wouldn't fight here. Dirk looked around after focusing beyond the four dukes. He saw a few dozen people, mostly adults, but many teens both girls and boys alike. These people scrutinized the envoys from the empire. They watched the grace of the nobles, judged the looks of the envoys, and wondered why Dirk was wearing a blindfold over his eyes. Eyes lingered on him for a while as they were all guided to a table near the core of the ballroom. And after they sat down, a maid continued to announce various names. Merchants who owned nationwide conglomerates, famous warriors and mages of the kingdom, famous craftsmen who found it in themselves to step out of seclusion. There were many high-profile names, and most brought their children. The ballroom was quickly filled as the sun continued to descend. There were soon over 200 people in the grand ballroom. Waiters had begun serving drinks and appetizers long ago. At some point, Cecilia sat next to Dirk and spoke to him quietly, doing some lessons on manners. It was only basic points like don't make messes and don't act like a barbarian, which Dirk understood. As for learning the more specific stuff, Cecilia didn't worry that much. Customs were different across empires, and she knew he wasn't dumb. It was why she taught him dancing first. Everything else he could handle. At some point, Dirk looked toward the center of the ballroom where a small stage and a dance floor were. There were a dozen women who stepped out dressed in clothing that resembled belly dancers. Ladies and gentlemen, before the queen graces us with her arrival, we present to you the dance of the dark dragon. When the place quieted down, an announcement was made that triggered the musicians on stage to play music. The dozen women lined up in specific positions before they moved. The women glided across the floor with nimble feet. And from the first movement, Dirk leaned forward. He sensed interesting movement in the dark man around their bodies. The women swung their arms and crossed paths as they jumped and spun. They weaved between each other, and from their fingers and feet came streaks of darkness that painted the air like a brush. This dark manna seemed to be placed chaotically at first, but over time, the women formed a figure with their wild movements. Dirk was surprised as he saw the formation. While leaning forward, he brought up his hands and began tracing the same formation in the air. Lines turned into vague runes as he did so, and he copied the women on the stage as if his fingers were dancers. He got a bit excited as he saw where it was going. Then, the dance reached its end. The women made their last moves, their last flicks of the hands, and completed the formation. Dirk completed it at the same time, and he suddenly felt a spatial power burst from the formation. It's void walking, but a bit different. He mumbled as the formation on stage kicked up waves of power. For a moment, a figure began to manifest, but it rapidly disappeared. Instead, Cecilia turned her head with a shocked gaze as Dirk admired the ingenious formation that controlled space. He had only seen some of this in void walking. It was clearly more advanced. Then, he froze as he felt a hand on his shoulder. Another hand reached in front of him, one with short but pointed blood-red nails. 
It opened and pointed its palm at the formation that was active in front of Dirk. Why your highness the queen has arrived? A nearby maid announced. At the same time, that hand took control of the formation Dirk made. The woman behind him, the queen of the Dark Kingdom, observed it as if admiring it. You have a unique understanding of space. The formation is the same, but the mana applied to it acts differently than the same mana on the stage. You're a curious one. Dirk felt a bit odd at the compliment. And unlike his vigilant mother, he was calm at the surprise presence behind him. He quickly understood the power of the woman, the queen, the moment he observed her with his mana vision. No, the moment she touched his shoulder, he felt something within him quiver. It was like all his vitality was going to be stolen at any moment. If she wished, she could pluck his soul from his body on a whim. His blood was already stagnant, as if awaiting her orders. She was the vampire queen. Clad in a black dress that released a faint black fog, she exuded both elegance and sex appeal. Her cherry red lips, pale skin, small pointed nose, large red eyes, and deep purple hair enchanted all who looked at her. In front of such a person, Dirk would usually be guarded and wary. But right now, he was amazingly calm. Thinking for a second, he stood from his seat. Spite, who had been relaxing on his lap, jumped and climbed onto his shoulder. He turned and faced the queen before giving a simple bow. Dirk Strider greets Her Majesty the Queen. It was a greeting that his mother just taught him only a couple of minutes ago, though he didn't expect the first person to use this with would be the Queen of the Dark Kingdom. She smiled at him, then Spite who observed her with her large golden eyes, before looking back at the formation in her hand. I was supposed to appear from the other void shift formation created by the dancers. But seeing yours, I changed my mind. Good job. Thank you. Mmm, study it. She put the formation into his hand before walking over to the stage. Dirk bowed a bit again before looking at the formation, noticing something different about it. There were more runes and lines, making it more complete. The one Dirk made was only a reception spell. The other half was the transmission spell. As he began inconspicuously tracing the runes with spite, the entire ballroom stood from their seats, greeting the queen. She smiled at everyone. I welcome everyone to our annual celebration of the advent of the Black Dragon. The sun is setting, and when the moons climb to their summit at the top of the sky, the advent will begin. Until then, do enjoy yourselves. The balconies, the surrounding skies, the food and drink, and the dance floor. The place is yours to roam. And so, I declare the start of this gala. The queen raised her hand with those words and pointed toward one of the walls of the ballroom. And with a burst of magic, the entire metal and glass wall shattered outward, reassembling into a large glass platform. From it, you could gaze at the vast city below, or appreciate the twinkling night sky above. Then, the queen took her place to the side on a grand table. With that, the groups that had been divided by table dispersed, finding others to mingle with. A few couples even walked to the dance floor as music started playing. The celebration had begun. Dirk sat back down in his seat as waiters brought out platters of food. Your father and I are going to greet some nobles. Have some fun while you're here, honey. Maybe find some others with Alec to talk to. Cecilia spoke as she linked arms with her husband. The two then walked off. Alec's father went another direction, and Duke Kyer went toward the table where the queen sat. The delegates also naturally dispersed, leaving Alec and Dirk alone. You didn't get washed by maids. I totally did. Dirk started laughing as Alec scowled. Shaking his head in refusal to believe Dirk's story, he stood. Come on. Are we going to talk to people? No. But we can't stay seated. Let's grab a drink and hang around. Okay. But why? Dirk questioned as they stood. Alec grabbed two drinks from a passing waiter, handing one of the glasses to Dirk. Dirk smelled liquor from it as well as mana. It was magic alcohol, a drink capable of getting even powerful mages drunk. The two took sips before finding a nearby pillar and leaning on it, getting a view of the ballroom. Alec quietly explained his actions. 
It's not rude, but being seated at a table with someone means that you aren't open to being disturbed. If you stand and wait around, it means you're open to being interacted with. So who exactly are we trying to talk to? Anybody. It's a social convention. You're supposed to be social. Not my forte. I can tell. Alec chuckled a bit. Then, he leaned over. So have any girls caught your eye? There's a few cute ones here. Ah, uh, no. No? Oh, well I guess you and Ava were a thing a couple years ago. But I'm pretty sure she left, didn't she? She was gone the day before you came back. Yeah, she's gone. Dirk spoke quieter than normal, obviously not happy at the mention. Alec pat his shoulder. Sorry. Well, maybe we can find you a nice girl who will cheer you up. Start looking. Or, sensing. How do you even see anyway? With my third eye. Dirk chuckled. While Alec glanced around, the two started talking about whatever came to mind. Occasionally they would grab food from a waiter who walked by, impressed by the taste of the small snacks and desserts. They also engaged in some stupid little games, like pitting little figures made of their elements against each other in small but fierce battles. Then, it was about half an hour later when Alec spotted a couple of girls step away from their group. He stopped engaging in the strength contest he was having with Dirk whereby they tried to squeeze the other's hand as hard as possible. Dirk also noticed the figures that walked toward them and let go of Alec's hand. Spite disappeared from Dirk's shoulder. Alec shook out his sore hand before smiling at the ladies. They curtsied. Dirk also gave a small bow, observing the two. There was a tall and short girl, though neither of them were taller than Dirk or Alec. The tall one, dressed in a slimming gray dress, was being led by the hand by the short one who wore a black dress, looking a bit more reserved and embarrassed than her friend. Hello ladies. Might I know your names? I'm Navy. This is my friend, Helen. The short one, Navy, introduced herself to her shy friend, Helen. Alex smiled while Dirk leaned back. Nice to meet you, Navy and Helen. I'm Alec, and this is my friend, Dirk. Would you like to sit with us? Actually, I think my friend here wants to dance, but you see, she's a bit too reserved for her own good. Navy whispered while glancing at Dirk. Helen shrunk back and glared at her friend. Navy, please. Anyway, I was hoping it wasn't too much to ask of you if you could humor my friend, Alec. Suddenly, Navy pulled Helen forward, basically handing her to Alec. Alec was a bit surprised by the forwardness, but just laughed. I don't mind at all. That is, if Miss Helen doesn't mind me having her first dance of the night. He stepped forward, putting his arm out like an escort. Helen reddened a bit before nodding. I. I don't mind. She linked her arm in his. Alec smiled widely, smirking at Dirk before walking to the dance floor. Dirk watched Alec leave with a snicker. Alec was smoother than he thought. Chapter 107, Pandora Dirk turned to Navy. She also turned after watching the Alec and Helen leave, smiling at Dirk. So you're Dirk Strider? That was impressive, what you did with the Queen. It was an accident. I just got curious about the formation and tried to copy it. And you succeeded. I surely couldn't. So you're a dark mage? Dirk asked, though he already knew the answer. He could see dark mana swirling around and within navy. It was a greater amount than his. She nodded. I am. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Navy Navora, daughter of Marquis Navora and Dark Mage of the Dark Kingdom's Magical College. Dirk Strider, son of Marquis Strider. Dirk gave another bow as Navy gave another curtsy. He thought she looked quite graceful, and he didn't mind her casual atmosphere. It made her easy to talk to. She tilted her head at his introduction. Are you not a mage of the Horizon Empire's Magic Academy? I was, but I haven't been back in over two years. It's difficult to call myself a student. So you graduated? Something like that. Dirk answered vaguely. 
he was definitely taught skills beyond what the academy taught at Azure's Mountain, so in a way, he really did graduate. Navy didn't pry further and looked toward one of the tables. Would you like to accompany me, Dirk Strider? I'm sure standing around for half an hour isn't easy on the legs. Yeah, sure. Dirk chuckled as he followed her to an empty table. It was small with three chairs. They took two, setting themselves up so they could watch the dance floor where Alec and Helen were at. My friend seemed to fall in love when she saw your friend. He sure stands out. Hmm. He's naturally valiant. Dirk smiled in agreement. Alec was tall and had a large presence, a natural-born leader. It was obvious he would stand out. Navy had a small grin as she saw her friend having a fantastic time on stage. Her black hair slumped down her shoulder as she leaned more towards the table. She was too shy though to actually approach you too. She watched you guys the entire time that you stood there. And you had to drag her over. She was so red, wasn't she? She almost looked sick. Ha, ah, she did. Even now her neck is burning up. Navy snickered when she glanced at her friend who was burning up in Alec's arms. Their bodies were pressed together, and she almost buried her head in Alec's chest out of shame. Dirk was a bit concerned. She looked almost uncomfortable. Is your friend okay? Oh, she's more than okay. I'd be more worried about your friend two hours from now. She might be shy, but if she gets past that, well. Navy's words trailed off, causing Dirk's eyebrows to raise. Alec had been jealous about Dirk's bath time story, but would he actually one-up Dirk in the end? Dirk felt a bit happy for his friend. Right as Navy began to concentrate her gaze on Dirk though, he frowned. What is that? Dirk suddenly felt something in his soul. It was that strange feeling he'd been having since arriving in the city. Only now, it was suddenly amplified, like a blocked signal that was finally unobstructed. His heart throbbed as he tried to recall where he remembered this familiar feeling. It felt like a bad omen, like something dark within him was trying to resurface. Something he never wanted to remember was calling out to him. Even as Navy tried to make more conversation, he was distracted. Eventually, he concentrated on her in an attempt to get his mind off of the bad feeling. The two bounced from topic to topic enthusiastically, but Dirk's mind was constantly clouded by that something in his soul. Then, when the sun set fully beyond the horizon, a maid stepped out. She made an announcement. The third child and princess of the Vampire Queen, Princess Pandora, has arrived. Everyone was silent when the announcement was made, but upon hearing the name, most people's eyes turned either serious or thrilled. They seemed to be even more excited about Princess Pandora's arrival than the Queen's. Everyone's eyes turned to a certain set of doors. From behind them, they could hear the clicking of shoes against the floor. Everyone's heart rates quickened in expectation. Especially Dirk's. As those clicking sounds got closer, that feeling in his soul grew stronger. Those dark memories grew clearer. His breath became a little rough. Princess Pandora. Navy seemed to be a fan as her eyes shimmered in excitement. Dirk shook his head though. Pandora. That name overlapped with another in his mind. Bang! Two large doors were shoved open by two large men. From between them, a girl walked forward. She wore a pure white dress that conformed to her slim bit curvy figure and exposed one of her legs through a slit that reached up her thigh. Her hair was the same deep purple of the Vampire Queen but with a tinge of red. The deep color of her hair contrasted against the bright dress, making it seem like the color was bleeding into the fabric. Her red eyes scanned around the ballroom, enchanting everyone just like her mother. Then, they stopped on Dirk. Dirk stood from his seat, his gaze glued to Pandora. The two seemed to connect in that moment. Pandora. Her previously dignified and elegant eyes widened, and then she smiled as wide as she could. In that moment, Dirk saw through the dignity. He remembered that name, and saw the touch of madness that didn't disappear even across worlds. Athena. Dirk looked at her almost as if he were looking at Azura. And she looked at him with ecstasy. Everyone in the room noticed the odd exchange, 
but several people went to go greet her anyway. But she didn't even look at them. She walked forward with almost hurried steps. That feeling within Dirk only got stronger. They could both feel it, the string between their souls. And she stopped in front of Dirk. His hand twitched when she got close, and the pistol appeared in it. She spoke with a dignified voice. Stand down. Excuse me? I wasn't talking to you. Pandora smiled when Dirk asked confusedly. Then, he suddenly felt a blade form a small cut on his neck. The cut healed within seconds, but Dirk still felt goosebumps. As if getting a hold of herself, Pandora took a step back. She looked around. Cecilia looked as if she were going to jump forward any second and attack, while Duke Kyer and Alec's father were frowning. They could see the assassin that had momentarily appeared behind Dirk. Pandora was well guarded. The tension in the atmosphere began to heat up, and not in a good way. I apologize for the inappropriate entrance, everyone. And to those who wish to greet me. I hope you'll forgive me, but I must speak to this young man. Pandora spoke to ease the atmosphere. Then, she turned back to Dirk, speaking with a softer tone. If you wouldn't mind accompanying me. She moved forward and linked arms with Dirk. He flinched, but followed her lead as they walked out toward the large open balcony. Everyone watched them with confused expressions. When the two arrived at a far corner of the balcony, they were suddenly surrounded in a dome of ice. Cecilia was going to step toward them, but when she saw the vague figure guarding the dome, she gritted her teeth and stayed put. She couldn't do anything rash here. Meanwhile, inside the dome of ice. Upon being isolated, Dirk's arm shot up. The pistol appeared again, and he pressed its barrel against her neck. She smiled in glee, speaking in a language only they knew. Super Soldier Designation 008 Don't call me that. Oh right, you have an actual name now. Dirk Strider, son of the War Mage Riker Strider and Dark Assassin Cecilia Strider. Oh, how I've dreamt of this day. Don't. As she pressed forward, he pressed the gun harder against her. It was as if he couldn't see her enchanting face. All he could see was the madness that he thought he escaped when he died. Feeling the barrel that was warming up, Pandora had a sly smile. She pressed her body against his. They were already really close. What are you going to do? Are you going to kill me here? My mother, the vampire queen herself, is within 100 meters of us. She could cut you down before you pull that trigger, and is focused intently on our current conversation despite my attempts at isolating us in magical ice. The only reason she isn't restraining you is because she can't understand the English language, and because I've got an icicle aimed right at your heart. Dirk frowned as she spoke. He could obviously see the icicle, but he couldn't feel the vampire queen spying on their conversation. She truly was unfathomably powerful. Pandora's smile only got crazier. Go ahead. Shoot me here. End my life. The tensions were already bad enough, but this will really do the job of starting the war. You want the lives of millions on your hands? You want to become a mummified corpse? You're the most ruthless super soldier on earth. Finish the mission you failed to so many years ago. Put a bullet into my skull. Dirk was silent as Pandora pressed her chest against his and strengthened her grip on his clothes. It was like she wanted this more than anything, and Dirk was remembering the psycho he once faced sixteen years ago. For a moment, he really wanted to pull the trigger. But her words actually made him hesitate. It wasn't due to the war, or because he would absolutely die. Finish the mission you once failed to. Those words echoed in his head. Suddenly, his arm dropped, and the pistol disappeared. I'm no longer the dog who was ordered around and disposed of. I'm not going to kill you, purely because of the fact that it would fulfill that mission. Oh my god. He's learned to think for himself. Ah. I'm so happy for you. She suddenly lunged forward, hugging his head. Dirk was a bit flustered by her move before pushing her body off his. Get off. Ah, come on. Why do you hate me so much anyway? Because you killed me. Literally. 
Yes. But I also gave you a new life. I was the one who granted you this opportunity by dragging you with me through that portal. You tried to resist so much, but look at you now. She raised her arms, motioning to Dirk's entire body. You are the son of a Marquis under one of the most powerful empires on this world. You have a mother who loves you enough to step forward when a tier 8 is blocking her path to you. And she even got you to learn how to dance. The coldest killer from the planet Earth was actually dancing with his mother. No amount of insanity could have convinced me before now that such a thing could happen. How do you know that? Please, as if every movement of the envoys isn't closely monitored at all hours of the day. Even then though, I had felt it. Our connection. I knew that it was one of you envoys when you arrived in the spire, so I had people watch you. Now I know that you were born just as privileged as I was. Talk about a turnaround. First orphans, and now the children of the highest echelons in this grand world of power. Pandora couldn't help her smile. The feeling of meeting Dirk like this, two souls from Earth who reunited on another world. It was surreal. All the information that only they knew felt like the most valuable secret in the world. Even Dirk couldn't help but acknowledge how extraordinary this meeting was. He was quickly engrossed by her words though. She was right. Her dragging him through that portal gave him this opportunity. It was another life. And it was one full of love and fulfillment. Dirk had his parents that cared for him, especially his mother. And then there was forging that Dirk had a new passion for. While he had a rough patch at Azure's Mountain, it turned him into a new man, one who had a strong mind and a new likeness for the people around him. He was someone who could be better friends with Alec and be more open to people. It was odd how such a hellish experience could change him like that, but his mother made such a change possible. It was her love that brought him out of his shell over his entire life. When they agreed to take down Azura together, it was like that shell had been removed. Hunt down Azura, and enjoy himself as he did so. This new zest for life made him a better person. And his strong mind ensured that he wouldn't stray from this goal. He could march forward through anything, and he would never worry about being hurt or broken. He could survive Azura, so he could survive anything. And the person who made this all possible, the one who forcefully dragged him along this path, was Pandora. Regardless of how she did it and who they were in the past, it was her that gave him this new life. But that was when Dirk remembered someone else. Grey, his sergeant and the closest thing Dirk had to a father as a super soldier. In the chaos she caused, he ultimately died. But she isn't at fault. It was the one who betrayed Dirk that caused this. The order to scrap him, and the fact that Grey had to save him from the people he once called his leaders and fellow soldiers. This betrayal had killed Grey, and it was why Dirk vowed never to be the dog he was in his past life. He looked at Pandora, who looked back at him with enchanting red eyes. Now, he wasn't nearly as hostile. He no longer thought of killing her. But he wasn't about to forget who she was. You're right. I am. You gave me this opportunity. I should technically be thanking you. Yes. But you're still a psycho. He frowned at her. When she heard him though, her face finally fell. Psycho? Just like you don't want to be called super soldier, I don't wish to be called such. What, have you suddenly grown a conscience? Actually, yes. She smirked at him. The Athena you knew back then. She's dead. She was stupid, impulsive, and blinded by the psychosis caused by being a failed super soldier. But me? I'm perfect. I have the vision. I have the mind that I was robbed of on that metal planet. I may have been a bit overexcited at your appearance, but do not think for a second that I'm the deranged idiot I was back then. Pandora shouted, obviously agitated. Dirk was surprised at her show of emotion. After quickly calming herself, she took a step away from Dirk. She regained her elegance, and that touch of madness, while still present in the back of her pupils, showed itself as a ruthlessly keen mind. Anyway. If you don't hate me now, can we have a calm conversation without any exaggerated physical exclamations? 
I'd like to get rid of the ice dome so that suspicions die down. It's not good for the diplomacy between our empires. Fine. Thank you. With a wave, the ice dome suddenly dispersed. Everyone in the ballroom turned their attention, seeing Dirk and Pandora standing on the edge of the balcony. Since Pandora wasn't done with her conversation, nobody approached. But they still kept their eye on their interactions. Let's continue our discussion in English. Pandora leaned on the guard railing on the edge of the balcony, her body turned toward Dirk. He faced her as well. Looking at her with an unclouded mind, he could finally see that enchanting face of hers. She truly was beautiful, even through his black and white vision. So you got that trait too, right? I'm talking about pure soul. Oh come on, there's no need to be so guarded. Yes, I have it. Dirk gave in and nodded. She smiled. So you also have perfect affinities? Perfect affinities? No, I don't. That's impossible. Your soul is pure, so there's no obstruction between you and the surrounding mana. You should have perfect affinities. When I got appraised as a child, they weren't perfect. But recently, my stigma formed, and now the affinities are unknown. Interesting. So it affected your affinities. And now you need a new appraisal? I guess. I haven't worried about it. Hmm. Then allow me. Suddenly, Pandora put her hands out. Dirk tilted his head. I know how to do appraisals. Just take my hands and lend me a bit of your mana. Fine. He raised his hands, placing his palms down on top of hers. After their hands touched, he felt a bit of mana stream into him. Amazingly, it was light mana. It formed a loop through their bodies, and some of Dirk's mana was caught in this loop, streaming into her. She analyzed the mana with her power. A few seconds later, the loop was cut. Check your profile. She spoke, and Dirk called his profile. Profile. Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, 3. Rank, 4. Attributes, Fire 100%, Lightning 100%, Earth 100%, Metal 100%. Dark 100%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7, Mana Resonance, Grade 5, Mana Lungs, Grade 5, Restoration, Grade 5. Stigma, Black Cat of Calamity. Seriously? Dirk was surprised. Every affinity was at 100%. That's what it means to have a pure soul. Normal souls are impure, and depending on the impurity, affinities are lowered. The most ordinary people have really impure souls, and their souls are incapable of communicating with mana. Conversely, you are capable of communicating fully with the mana around you. Your soul is also stronger, having theoretically no limits to its ability to grow. You've become aware of your soul before, right? Yeah. Dirk nodded in a bit of a daze to think he had perfect affinities this entire time. It was no wonder I saw all the elements around me with the same clarity, despite having differing affinities. I guess that's why I have greater mental energy than those my level too. He connected several dots in his mind. Pandora enjoyed his dazed expression for a bit. So in exchange for appraising you, how about we exchange information? You tell me your attributes, I'll tell you mine. You tell me your traits and skills, and I'll tell you mine. Then you can tell me why your eyes have been horribly cursed and where you've been all these years. Why do you want to know so much about me? What, you think I was just going to say hello and goodbye? As if I would look past this catastrophic opportunity. I know exactly what you're capable of and what you can become. And I know many things that you probably don't about this world and the secrets that lurk in the dark. Together, we are capable of turning this world on its head. We'll both grow to unfathomable heights. I dare say that we have the closest bond among anybody else in our new lives. We can support each other perfectly. Dirk's face scrunched up a bit as her madness began to leak out again. He was also a bit curious though. Despite his apprehensions, 
Dirk also didn't wish to just part ways. While he didn't agree that they had the closest bond, he did acknowledge their unique relationship. And even back on Earth, she was a mastermind. Now, her psychosis was non-existent, and due to this supernatural world, their minds were on a whole new level. He really couldn't fathom how diabolically smart she was. Her only limiter was removed. If her brains and his surgical brawn combined, they really could do amazing things. But what would we do anyway? Dirk only had one enemy, and it had nothing to do with Pandora. They had no common goals or paths that crossed. Would she just start having him take care of her dirty work? If that was the case, he would immediately refuse. But she wasn't stupid enough to do that. No, he could practically taste the schemes brewing in that devious mind of hers. He was curious, and a bit afraid of her ambition. But he would at least hear her out, even if only because of the fact that he felt drawn to her. Their situation was too special, so he couldn't help it. Chapter 108, Pact Pandora was smart. Back on Earth, she took control of the entire criminal underworld, becoming a global crime lord. And that was when she was driven crazy by the Super Soldier program. Now, she had the same smarts, but without the insanity. If you added her powers gained from the reincarnation and her power as a mage, along with her influence as the daughter of the Vampire Queen and Princess of the Dark Kingdom, she was a tiger with wings. She couldn't be put in a better situation. But then, Dirk suddenly remembered something. I have a question. He asked Pandora who looked at him with expectation. I'll answer it. The war. There was word that the huge shift in the Dark Kingdom involved the princess. Then I saw machines and modern technology with your name on it. Now, I know that you're the reason for this situation. You're bringing radical change. Why? Dirk asked with a serious face. Now that he knew exactly who she was, he automatically knew the reason for the recent hostility between their empires. She was the sole reason. The biggest question was why. What was her aim? She smiled, liking the question. This world is both modern and primitive compared to Earth. The science is primitive, but the magic brings similar capabilities that science brought on Earth. Like the spire we're on. It stands at 1,000 meters tall. That's something only the most advanced engineering on Earth could build. But here, it only takes powerful enchantments. So what if you combined both science and magic? The possibilities are limitless. While I wasn't a scientist on Earth, I still knew advanced knowledge. I had to build my own tech that could help me evade capture for so long, after all. And now you want to bring modern technology to this planet? Exactly. I've already done so across my 16 years of life. It was only in the last four years that I was able to get taken seriously. From there, I garnered support with benefits and grew my prestige. Now I'm a brand that all the nobles know and respect. But of course, I won't settle for just a little recognition and fame. Thus, I built one revolutionary technology. What? Trains. She smiled in glee. Trains revolutionized the Western world when everyone still used wagons. Machines that used water and coal to barrel down rails at high speeds, bringing along with it massive amounts of cargo. Months of transportation turn to days. And while the wagons in this world are capable of driving as fast as cars, they can't do so in large volumes because such products are too expensive. Trains are cheap, especially in this world where materials without mana are cheap as dirt. So I took full advantage of it. I spent some time designing the trains, then used my little amount of influence to lay down a single railway from the capital city to another prosperous city. From there, my train exploded in popularity, and train networks are currently under construction across the entire kingdom. All of them are owned by me, no less. So why is a war necessary? The dwarves. Pandora spoke simply. The dwarven haven is the most economically and technologically prosperous empire in this world. I've already spoken with some noble dwarves, and we've agreed that a rail network between our nations will benefit us massively. Now, all we need is the territory that connects us to them. 
why can't you just build the network and let the Horizon Empire keep their territory? Because I have no need to bend like that. I get more out of fighting for that territory and owning it than I do paying taxes on transferring goods. Not only that, but the territory we would gain wouldn't actually become that of the Dark Kingdoms. You mean Dash? It'll become mine. I'm a princess of the Dark Kingdom and a high tier 4 mage who is capable of owning her own fief. But instead of cashing in on that fief, I've pulled the support of nobles who control soldiers, deciding to carve out my own territory from the Horizon Empires. I'll then be the one who stands between the two empires and their economic prosperity. That small sliver of territory will provide me the same economic growth as half an empire. I'd become the single richest person in this world. And that's only the start. What about the world tree? What about unity? What about the Horizon Empire? I could become a global conglomerate who controls the supply lines of the world's superpowers, and nobody could stop me, because nobody knows the modern science that I do. Even if they replicated it magically, they can't do it cheaply like I can. Your madness is leaking out. Dirk mumbled as Pandora laid out her plan. Truly, it was a fantastic plan that would give her endless wealth. And she had a monopoly on the knowledge needed to do all this. Then there was her backing. What if someone tried to kill her? Well, Dirk had moved to, but he was stopped by an invisible assassin who could stand right behind him and remain unnoticed. She obviously had powerful people under her, as well as the support of her empire. At least right now, nobody could stop her. She had power over the military, and she was going to fight for that territory. But why do you need this endless wealth? You can't just be greedy for money. Dirk refused to believe she was so shallow. There was something deeper there. When he asked that question, Pandora's smile faded. She turned serious. It's to prepare. For what? I'm not sure. But something is coming. This world isn't as simple as you think. And, you remember the portal, right? Dirk's face darkened. The portal she stole, and the serums that allowed one to enter it. Her stealing that portal spelled the downfall of her global criminal syndicate. And it turns out, it truly was a cataclysmic piece of technology. That portal led to another world entirely. Who's to say that they won't develop it again? Who's to say that tomorrow, an army of super-soldiers won't march right into this land and herald an invasion? I left behind a bomb that not only wiped out the tech, but released information that could spell civil war in every major country around the world. I left behind a seed of immeasurable chaos. But the chaos won't last forever. Someday, they will come back and build that portal once more. Even disregarding the secrets about this world, I'm preparing for that inevitable day. And Dirk, it's been 16 long years. How much more time do you think we have left? Dirk felt his heart pound. He hadn't thought of that. And if Earth truly did build that technology, what would happen to this world? It wasn't like he was suddenly an enemy of Earth's, but their arrival would herald a war between two worlds. How many people would die in such a war? Pandora stepped closer to him. She was getting excited again. She raised her hand and cupped his cheek. Dirk, we're the only ones in this world who know what we know. We have pure souls capable of limitless growth. I want to share the secrets I know with you. I want us to know each other's power. Then, we can go and become leaders of a revolution. We may have been enemies before, but neither of us are the same. We're better than we were. I can already see how far you've come from that ruthless killer who stared at me with apathy. Your soul. I feel warmth from it. She leaned forward, bringing their faces closer. Dirk was drawn in, almost mesmerized. She was only a few inches shorter than him, so she only had to rise on her toes a bit. But he maintained clarity of mind. Pandora smiled. What do you say? You and me. Let's take this world by storm, before it sweeps us off our feet first. I've only just begun, and now that you're here, nothing can stop us. Work with me, Dirk. With me, you won't be a dog who follows orders. You won't be bound by any empire or military. 
we'll be a king and queen who honor the world as we please. Our purpose will be ours to decide. So, will you join me? She looked into his gaze with fanaticism. When she thought about the future and what it could be made into under their power, she shivered in excitement. Dirk looked back at her. Perhaps it was due to their connection, but he could feel her anticipation. And with her large chest pressed against him, he could feel her heart race. Dirk breathed a little rough. For some reason, he was finding it hard to resist her charm. And for a minute, he thought hard about it. The things she knew, the things he knew may happen in the future. It was too big to ignore. As she said, they needed to move now to keep from getting swept off their feet in the future. If it were before, he would have rejected anything she put forward. But she was convincing, and Dirk wasn't as inflexible as he used to be. While he was concerned about her desire for war, he could at least talk to her if they became close and cooperative. That wouldn't happen if he rejected her. So he made the decision he wanted to. And not just for the Horizon Empire. He wanted to work with her. He was also a bit excited over the future after hearing her words. All right. Letting out a heated breath, he gave his answer. Pandora smiled. Really wide, as if in ecstasy. Then, if you don't mind. Suddenly, she pulled herself off of him. He was confused as she grabbed his arm, raising his forearm to her mouth. What are you doing? Vampires are capable of creating blood packs. I want to make one with you. What kind of pact? A small one. One that represents our bond. It'll leave a mark on your body as well as mine. Others will see this mark, and if they're aware of blood packs, they'll understand our connection. At least, within the Dark Kingdom, it'll tell everyone that you're my equal. Though, I guess I should warn you. Do this, and you'll get entangled in all the diplomacy between our empires. I'm the center of the war effort, and you'll have a direct bond with me. It wouldn't be odd if people become suspicious. Of course, I'll be capable of protecting you. Dirk was silent for a moment. At that moment, when the people in the ballroom realized what Pandora was doing, things got a little loud. Pandora? Don't disturb me, mother. Pandora responded rudely to the vampire queen who had stood from her table and walked over. Duke Kyer was behind her, looking at Dirk with concern. Cecilia also walked over as people began to converge. Dirk? What's going on? She asked, but Dirk's gaze was focused on Pandora. Both only looked at each other, even under the gazes of several people who stood at the top of the world's power hierarchy. Pandora, do you understand what you're doing? I asked you to not disturb me, mother. And you know the answer to that question anyway. Who is this child? The vampire queen suddenly asked. Of course, she knew who Dirk Strider was. He was the son of Riker and Cecilia Strider, a mere tier three mage of the Horizon Empire. But that wasn't what she was asking. It was clear that there was a deeper relationship between Pandora and Dirk. It baffled everyone present. After all, neither had ever come into contact with each other in any way, shape, or form. And then, they started speaking in a weird language. Something was going on, and now, they were establishing a blood pact. It was a serious occurrence. Pandora really was the center of the war effort, and Dirk was about to get pulled right into the heat of it. He would become immeasurably important. If he accepted. Dirk sighed. He knew what he would get himself into even before Pandora told him. She was chaos incarnate, more so than Eldritch Primordial in Dirk's opinion. But still, he was willing. He turned his forearm, exposing the soft underside. He couldn't help a small smile from surfacing. I'm really getting into trouble now, huh? Seeing his acceptance, Pandora opened her mouth. I'll be gentle. Bite. Her two sharp teeth came down on his arm, and the surrounding people froze. Then, their faces scrunched up. M-P-H. M. Everyone became a bit awkward as Pandora moaned in bliss. Dirk could only smile blankly, feeling her body shiver in delight. So much for hiding your delicious blood. 
Dirk nodded inwardly in agreement. After he felt a bit of his blood be sucked out by her cute lips, Pandora pulled away. She licked a bit of red that streamed down her lips, looking Dirk in the eye. He didn't feel anything take form though. He looked at her confusedly, only to be hugged by the neck. Aye. Amazing. Your neck. She let out a hot breath as she planted her mouth on the side of his neck. Then, when she started sucking again, Dirk could feel a bit of magic activate. Her blood streamed into him, burning as the catalyst for her magic. Markings formed on his skin under her mouth. Her neck saw markings form as well as his blood streamed into her. With each other's blood, they formed a pact, and Dirk was able to feel the creation of this pact. It was an equal pact. There wasn't any power over the other person built into the pact. As she said, it was more symbolic, a way of showing their bond. But for a moment, Dirk felt something deeper form itself into the pact. Nothing malicious, but a way to transfer power through blood. It would allow her to siphon power from him by drinking his blood. But when he was about to reject it, the formation stopped, going back to a normal pact. When the markings fully formed, Pandora finally pulled away, albeit unwillingly. She looked at him with a heated gaze, taking a few deep breaths. The small wounds she formed disappeared quickly, and Dirk was only left a bit weaker due to the blood loss. After a few seconds, Pandora corrected her posture, backing away and returning to her elegant self. She turned to the vampire queen with a bit of a flushed face. We'll talk later, mother. First, I should attend to the guests that have been waiting on me. Come, everyone. Let's find ourselves a table. Standing for so long is bad on the knees. Pandora walked past the queen with a large smile, happy as can be. Everyone who heard her offer, though confused by what just happened, followed her happily. She was not just the center of the war effort, but the center of the recent explosive economic growth. Any opportunity to talk with her could result in immense profits. A group of men and women followed her toward a large table. Dirk was left behind, focused on her back. Then, he turned to the vampire queen who looked at him with an odd gaze. Dirk? Are you okay? Cecilia walked right past the queen, checking Dirk's arm and neck. He smiled wryly. I'm fine, Mom. Do you care to explain what's going on? It's complicated. Maybe later? Fine. She looked at him worriedly before sighing. Then, she turned toward the queen and Duke Kyer. Duke Kyer looked at Dirk before turning to the queen. Vampire queen. I think it would be more suitable for us to finish our discussion before handling new variables. Perhaps. She lightly nodded. With one last glance at the mark on Dirk's neck, she turned and walked back to her table. Duke Kyer followed, and Dirk was left alone. I want you to come with me. Why? To have a bit of fun. A few hours after the scene caused by Dirk and Pandora, the ballroom had gone back to its festive atmosphere. She had also spoken with a couple dozen people over the course of those few hours. Now, the two moons were close to reaching the top of the sky. The advent of the dark dragon was close to reaching its climax. And Pandora wanted to pull him away. After she linked arms with him, the two walked to the edge of the balcony. In the sky around the balcony, there were several people flying in the sky. They all had magic devices under their feet that left long streaks of light in the dark sky wherever they moved. Throughout the night, Dirk felt the power of the dark mana coming from the abyss below the city become stronger. It made everyone weightless. Even from up high in the spire, they could feel it almost eliminate gravity altogether. Pandora pulled Dirk to an unguarded edge. Then, she looked at him. Do you trust me? Not necessarily. Ouch. Well, follow my lead anyway. Saying that, Pandora moved forward. Dirk was hesitant, but also lifted his leg and stepped off the edge. And they fell down. Ha ha. Pandora laughed as she free fell toward the ground, the wind making her dress flap. Dirk was a bit nervous as he saw the ground get closer, but at some point, his speed didn't increase. He was falling slowly. 
The wind wasn't harsh as the two moved downward side by side. Dirk could see the spire that pierced the sky and the ground below that was glowing with millions of lights. Then, Pandora put out her hands. She grabbed Dirk's hands, and a wind was suddenly kicked up. Dirk was surprised when he felt the air element. And they no longer fell. From 400 meters in the air, they floated weightlessly. Pandora smiled widely. Spatial Repulsion Every year, the hole below the city releases built-up spatial power and makes the city weightless by counteracting gravity. The field of limbo usually rises to about 600 meters above ground level. Anybody can fly around within this field, and it gradually diminishes as the sun rises. They call it the night of dragon flight. It's amazing. Dirk spoke in a daze. He had never felt weightless like this, and he had never personally flown. He had heard of air mages and those with extreme power who could fly as they pleased. Even Riker could fly with his fire magic. But Dirk wasn't that powerful. It was an unbelievable experience, filling him with wonder. Pandora chuckled before pulling his arm. Come on. There's something cooler. With a gust of wind, the two descended. They passed all the cheering citizens who flew and danced in the sky with magic devices, coming upon the ground entrance to the spire. She led him to a certain wall within an empty hallway inside the building. There, a secret door opened, and they drifted in. Around them was black nothingness. Looking down, Dirk saw the abyssal hole under the city, and above, he could see the night sky and two moons. The place Pandora brought him to led directly under the city through a hole that went all the way up the spire. Don't worry, we won't fall in. Even during a normal day, falling into the hole is impossible. Let me show you. She pulled him along when she felt his nervousness. The two descended below the city's ground level. When Dirk looked around, he was surprised to see hundreds of structures built from the ground under the city. At all times during the year, there's a constant spatial repulsion coming from the hole. This repulsive force and gravity usually meet directly under the city. It forms a zero-gravity layer under the city about 20 meters wide. There have been many structures set up for industry and study here, taking advantage of the eternally weightless environment. It's been great for magical and even scientific development, as little as there is. Come on. There's more. With excitement, she pulled him again. The two descended even further before reaching a platform. After stepping onto this platform, their orientation was inverted, and gravity returned. Now, Dirk's feet walked on the bottom of the city, pointing to the sky. When he looked back down into the hole and saw the two moons below him, he was a bit disoriented. Crazy, isn't it? That's reality here. Imagine if this were on Earth. I can't. Dirk couldn't imagine something like this in his lifetime. It was so amazingly fantastical that his worldview was flipped upside down. Chapter 109, War Cataclysma After staring at the two moons below him for a while, Pandora pulled Dirk along. The two entered a building and then emerged onto a street. Around them was another city, only much smaller. Dirk also felt the gravity get stronger. When he looked up, he peered into the abyss. Is this another city? It is. This city is much smaller though. The deeper you go into the hole, the stronger the spatial repulsion gets. Nobody has been able to build a structure that extends more than 150 meters downward. So most buildings are short, and nobody with a weak body can live here long term without hurting themselves. But it's great for the powerful people. Body refiners become stronger after training here, and the place is thick with dark mana, allowing dark mages to naturally comprehend the element faster. It would be fantastic for you to live here since you're both of those things. Hmm. What are those lights though? Dirk pointed towards some bright lights in the sky, or, in the hole. They reached much higher than the buildings and looked like stars. Those are levitation discs. We shoot spatial power at them from a device on the ground and make them float against the repulsion. There are contests to see who can make theirs float the highest. Is that it? Of course not. 
In order to make them float so high and against so much power, everyone has to refine their manipulation of the dark element and spatial power. Those levitation disks are the foundation for most of the spatial devices we use throughout the Dark Kingdom. Countless advancements have been made in magic, enchanting, and technology from those little disks alone. So don't think they're just pretty little lights, although, the lights were put there to make them look like stars. But you get the point. Pandora spoke a bit smugly, proud of her accomplished empire. Dirk nodded while looking at the dozens of little lights up above. Pandora hummed a bit as they walked before glancing at the side of Dirk's face. Specifically his neck where the blood pact was formed. The mark that was left was a bit smaller than a palm. It was a deep red that flowed with power. There were a pair of large reptilian wings, and above these wings sat an eye in chains. It was the royal mark of the Dark Kingdom, one that nobody would carelessly bear in the open and nobody would falsely claim to truly possess. One might think that getting their hands on a royal seal was good fortune. But all empires and kingdoms enforced brutal punishment upon those who would dare sully or forge their seal. Therefore, the shape of the seal was well known among all, yet it was rare to actually see a genuine mark. When one saw this seal, they knew they were in the presence of royalty. Now, both Dirk and Pandora bore this mark on their necks. Pandora didn't need to worry about such things. She was royalty anyway, and incredibly famous. But Dirk wasn't, and now he walked in the open with it. Not to say that he was in danger, but his status was affected massively with this single mark. At least it doesn't look bad on you. The tattoo? I still think it would have been better on my forearm. Sorry. Your blood was just too delicious. Seriously, I've never tasted such luscious blood in all my life, and I've been fed the best. What's up with that? My blood has been enhanced several times over. I'm an anima trainer as you discovered, and my mana cultivation technique infuses mana throughout my blood. Then there was an accident that genetically altered my blood to supposedly that of a dragon's, or something close to it. I knew that my blood would taste good to vampires, so I intended to keep it hidden. But. I got to it first. Pandora cheered as if accomplished. At the same time, she was a bit surprised. Not just by all the different things that enhanced his blood, but the fact that he told her. Dirk smirked when he saw her happiness. He didn't have a problem revealing this information since they would be revealing a lot more to each other soon. While he was cautious of her, he also wanted to work with her. She was smart, and although she had her own goals, he had his own too. If he could use her to find and take down Azura, then he was willing to reveal as much as necessary. Besides, there wasn't much she could do with this information. Just because one told you their strengths didn't mean you could find their weakness. But there was another reason Dirk told her. Though, he didn't like it. I feel too, drawn to her. Like she's attractive or something. Well, she is, but she's black on the inside. It's that soul connection. Dirk could feel it deep inside him. There was that string between their souls. Before, they were separated by entire empires, so the string was weak. But now, as she was linked arms with him, it was as strong as it could get. Dirk was feeling drawn in, and no doubt she was to him. But it nonetheless messed with his head. He felt like his mind would be clouded if he let his guard down but it still had its subconscious effect. Dirk was feeling more open, more willing to speak to her. She felt familiar, and combined with her new princess self, she was like a beautiful partner. But Dirk was uncomfortable with this closeness. He actively reminded himself of who she was. He couldn't just spill all his secrets. Hey! Suddenly, Pandora nudged his side. He looked over, seeing her flushed face. Can I, get more blood? My blood isn't limitless, you know. But, but it's so good. Just a bit. I'll be sure to get you some foods rich in nutrients and mana. You'll regenerate your blood in no time. I refuse to be your blood bag. It's not like that. And I wanted to make the blood pact more than just a symbolic bond, but you didn't like that. I know. I saw the quick change. Dirk had a small grin. 
He had detected that addition, but she quickly got rid of it when she sensed his displeasure. That thing you didn't like would allow me to rely on the vitality in your blood and empower myself. It would also be less detrimental to you. If we had that, then I would be more than just some leech who enjoys the succulent waves of taste your blood gives me. Pandora shivered a little when she remembered that taste. It was more than just taste. She felt it through her entire body, the pure and bountiful vitality in that blood. It filled her mind and body with ecstasy. It was truly delectable. That's why she suddenly added that other pack to the mark. Dirk looked at her weirdly. I thought you just got the vitality from the blood anyway. Why do you need a pact for it? Because drinking blood normally is just a shallow exchange of shallow vitality. Vampires aren't just parasites, Dirk. We don't just take. With a true blood pact, a vampire can stimulate the vitality of their partner, as well as their own. Then, they can compound off of each other. I don't get how that can help me. Ah. Uh, well, then I'll use a weird metaphor. You know that sex makes babies. Sex? What's that? Shut up. Anyway, when two people have sex and conceive a baby, life is created. In this magical world, it starts the process of combining the vitality of two different people and making something more. Two sources of vitality compound off each other. It's the same thing with a blood pact. I drink your blood and the rivers of our vitality interact. This results in mutual benefit, but I will say, the vampire doing the drinking does in fact get more. Still, you would at least get something out of it. There's only one downside though. What is it? The vampire becomes, reliant. Pandora's previously smiling face turned a little darker. The vampire can only interact with the vitality of the one they have a blood pact with. Over time, their vitalities become more intertwined, and at some point, the vampire can no longer engage in such interactions with anyone else. This is actually the reason that vampires mate for life. Two vampires who constantly combine their vitality become dependent on each other, leading to an irreversibly strong bond. It also means they're careful of those they choose to make a blood pact with. If one dies or they separate, it can be incredibly debilitating. Interesting. Dirk was shocked at this new information. He didn't realize they had such powers. It was actually rather amazing that they could just naturally do this. But why would you make one with me then? If it was such a big decision, why would Pandora make one with him? She wasn't that crazy. Right? She smiled. Luckily, there are blood packs of different types and strengths. The one I wanted to form was a more parasitic one that would take more vitality than we combined. It would provide only a little benefit to you and a good amount to me, making the blood more effective for me while not making me reliant. Besides, forming even a full blood pact with you wouldn't be such a bad idea. Why is that? Because I don't believe it's possible for you to die. You're too tenacious. Not even I could kill you, and believe me, I really wanted to for a long time. You actually did in the end. No. Your soul is the same. Not true death. Anyway, I'm not more confident in anybody's ability to survive than yours, even in this new world. Forming a blood pact with you wouldn't be a bad decision. And of course, you would have the purest vampire as your partner, so it couldn't be better for you. She smiled as she wrapped her arms around his neck. He frowned as her deep red eyes bored into his magical gaze. He shouldn't be so comfortable with this. She whispered as she got close. So anyway, how about a little bite? Dirk remained silent, but in his hesitation, she moved in. He felt a small pinch where the mark was. Pandora let the blood flow, like a small stream of red wine down his neck. Dirk got goosebumps as her tongue and lips enjoyed every drop of blood they could. Added to the fact that her entire body was pressed against him and they looked like two lovers getting too cozy in the middle of the street. Pandora was obviously heated as she pushed even deeper, and Dirk couldn't help himself either. But as if showing off his inhuman willpower, he eventually grabbed her and peeled her off his body. She looked devastated as her bite mark healed within a couple seconds. I. 
I'm not your food, damn it. Dirk cursed as he growled at her. After taking her mind off the heavenly taste and euphoria of Dirk's blood, she smiled a bit. His rough breath and narrowed brows painted a dangerous picture. Oh my! Are you going to take me right here? The princess of the Dark Kingdom was just voraciously sucking your blood, and you felt every inch of her goods. You wanna rip my clothes off? You could take me right in that alleyway, and I'm not sure if I would stop you. I must admit, being together with you, being close to you, sucking your blood like that. It's truly pleasurable. Click. Suddenly, as Pandora was making her way into Dirk's arms again, she froze. A cold barrel placed itself under her chin. She felt Dirk's aura that was just as cold as the barrel. Back off. I don't know if it's the soul bond we have or some kind of subtle magic you're using, but I'm getting a bit too comfortable with you for my liking. Don't think I've forgotten who you are. Sorry. Pandora stepped back as Dirk pressed his gun a bit more. He was slightly surprised as she looked genuinely apologetic. I guess now is a good time to tell you one of my skills, something I was given upon my rebirth. Temptation. A grade 7 skill that acts passively, for the most part. It does exactly as it says and draws people toward me, or more like makes them bend to my will. For handling politicians and merchants, it's a great tool. But it's not so good for situations like this. So you are using magic. Hey, I can't fully control it. Believe me, it used to be much worse. Dirk frowned as she shouted back. Eventually, he put away the gun. Fine. Now I know to keep my guard up. Hey, the fact that you were able to pull yourself out means it has limited effect on you. You might have been a little entranced, but it was only temporary. Trust me, people who get entranced don't recover like that. But your mind is abnormally strong. Along with your pure soul, I can't do anything to you. I'll decide whether or not to trust your passive power. Suit yourself. With a small huff, Pandora turned and walked past Dirk. He turned and followed. Anyway, this is the undercity of the capital. Since we'll be working together now, I suggest you find a way to stay here so you could train. I noticed that your magical strength is small. You aren't even tier 4 yet. I was unable to cultivate mana for a couple years. Why? I'll tell you later. Dirk didn't answer. Pandora didn't push, just leading Dirk back the way they came to cross over to the upper city. Well, I've got nigh unlimited resources to help cultivate. Along with good food, I'll give you what you any dash. Rumble. Interrupting Pandora, the two suddenly felt the ground shake. Dirk also felt the dark mana all around him become incredibly volatile. It was almost going berserk. Pandora smiled. It's coming. Quick, let's get into the sky. What? What's coming? The dark dragon. She smiled as she pulled him along. Like that, the two jumped back into the hole, only to be launched upward by the spatial repulsion. Dirk could hear massive chains clanging together. They were the chains that anchored the city above the hole. The dark manor really was getting wild. Pandora and Dirk arrived back in the spire, exiting before jumping into the air. They could see the two moons that were now at the top of the sky. There are six primordial dragons, and those six dragons are basically gods of their element. They have their six dungeons, known as the ancient lairs. Under those ancient lairs are the major and lesser dungeons. Lesser dungeons are where people like students fight in. Major dungeons are home to the truly powerful monsters. But the ancient lairs, those house the primordial dragons. Don't tell me Dash. This city sits right on top of the ancient lair of darkness, the home of the primordial dragon of darkness. That endless abyss below us is the entrance. And every year, at midnight on this very day, the primordial dragon himself emerges from his lair to grace the world with his presence. Pandora was wondrous as she flew with Dirk in the air. Before Dirk could even be surprised, his mind was shaken. Roar! It wasn't a sound that one heard with their ears. The roar pierced into everyone's minds, though it didn't hurt. 
everyone around Pandora and Dirk turned their gazes downward. Dirk didn't have normal vision, so everything was seen either through mana or in black and white. Still, in his mana vision, he could suddenly see it as if looking through the massive city below. An enormous being, one so amazingly powerful and grand that people with lesser minds began to bow in awe. This being of darkness, one that was different from Eldritch Primordial, shot out of the endless abyss below and into the sky. Its body was far larger than the city itself, its mere head able to swallow it whole. It was like it had been curled up within that six-mile-wide hole, revealing a body that was at least fifty miles long and ethereal. It soared through the city, into the sky, and across the lands, its body stretching across the black horizon. It was a dragon, with four massive clawed legs, wings that covered the sky, a barbed tail that could sweep over valleys, and a scaled body that radiated the power of darkness. Dirk had to lift his head and spin his body around to see the entire being that was both majestic beyond words and horrifyingly menacing. After bringing its body out into the world, the dragon opened its deep red eyes. Its massive head loomed over the city, seeing through its inhabitants in but a moment. For the residents of this capital city, they had seen this many times before, and everyone cheered the arrival of the great dark dragon. But Dirk could barely move. This was because he felt the dragon's gaze focus on him. Dirk was terrified at the unfathomable power within that dragon. He could almost see and feel the dragon's heart beating in its chest, causing the dark man heart within Dirk to beat in synchronous. Pandora, on the other hand, met this gaze directly. For her, this also wasn't the first time she had seen the dark dragon. In her sixteen years of life, she had seen it fifteen times before, every single year. Dark Dragon Primordial Suddenly, everyone heard a voice. They looked up and saw the Vampire Queen, and she floated closer to the dragon's head. Her voice was respectful, containing awe and reverence. She even bowed, but before this massive and godly being, that was understandable. But the Dark Dragon didn't look at her. It kept its gaze on Dirk. Eldritch Primordial What? Pandora was shocked when she heard the Dark Dragon speak. At the same time, Eldritch Primordial, the one who stuck near Dirk's soul and fought him for domain over the Dark Element, narrowed its abyssal eyes. Dirk felt like he could see the Dark Dragon smile. He didn't know what to do. In fact, there was nothing he could do. He didn't even know what was going on. The Dark Dragon's smile widened. Yes. Yes. You, who is named Dirk Strider. You have a pure soul, a golden soul of discipline and order. Yet, you wield the dark element of chaos, your opposite. Eldritch Primordial. You have made contact with and attached yourself to this pure soul in an attempt to attain a vessel. You have even allowed this soul to obtain source mana. You wish to lure him. You are emerging into the world once more. This violates our covenant. You have violated the covenant, that which has stood for countless millennia. I call upon primordial light. I am here. Suddenly, Dirk heard the system itself speak. It was the same system that gave them their profile and skills. And it was actually speaking. Primordial dragon of light. What is your judgment? I have also violated the covenant. I have attached myself to and assisted the girl known as Pandora Venatis. She who has a grey soul of chaos yet wields the light element of order. There are now two counts of violation. He. Ha ha ha. The dark dragon roared in laughter, shaking Dirk's mind. Then this is it. The covenant has been broken. Peace shall be no longer. The denizens of the gods and dragons shall rage. The elements shall reign free. Hear me, eldritch primordial, and sovereign divine. The dragon rose high into the sky, looking toward the two moons beyond the world. Before, the people below couldn't hear, but now, they could hear the words the dragon spoke clearly. He who heralds calamity has finally arrived. She who heralds revolution has finally arrived. War cataclysma, shall rage once again. Asterisk roar. Asterisk. The dark dragon shook the world with its declaration. At the same time, 
Dirk's soul trembled uncontrollably. The night of fate had arrived. Chapter 110 Secret When Dirk felt his soul tremble, his awareness was actually cast into the mana dimension. He could see Eldritch Primordial, and he radiated pure hate. The Dark Dragon had actually appeared there as well. It was coiled behind and around Dirk, glaring at Eldritch. Then, there were millions of tentacles that suddenly shot towards them. Dirk could feel the absolute suppressive power of that barrage. A single one of those tentacles could wipe him from existence. It's like your intelligence has regressed further. The dark dragon roared at that moment, and with a breath of darkness, destroyed every single tentacle. Damn dragon! It's futile, Eldritch! This child has usurped source mana by your will. You intended to lure him and eat him, but now, here I stand. By my power, he shall take everything from you, just as you took everyone from me. No! You cannot stop me. You lack what it takes to destroy me. You're right. I don't have the source. But it is no longer I who will destroy you. You just keep on hiding, you ugly squid. Your day of reckoning is fast approaching. Silence. With rage, Eldritch Primordial continued to attack the Dark Dragon who protected Dirk. At that moment, in the real world, the actual Dark Dragon looked back down at Dirk. It shot down toward him until its massive face filled Dirk's vision. You, human child named Dirk Strider. With my power, you shall become capable of usurping the Dark Elemental Source mana without that squid's interference. I shall entrust you with this goal, and you shall do so in order to grow your power. Primordial Light. I am here. You know what to do more than I. Prepare your child, for I shall call down Sovereign Divine. It will be done. Good. Oh, how I have waited for this day. With another bout of laughter, the dark dragon flew in circles in the sky. War shall rage. And with another gleeful declaration, he disappeared across the horizon, becoming one with the night's darkness. The entire city was silent. Then, Dirk suddenly saw something. In the mana dimension, the dark dragon coiled around Dirk shot into his soul. Then, a mark was engraved on his chest. It was that of the dragon, and it was alive with its power. Then, Dirk returned to reality. The same mark was engraved on his skin, becoming a tattoo that sat over his left chest. Dirk felt the sting, but it was otherwise painless. Not only that, but the small wound on Dirk's soul was healed, removing that dull eternal pain. Attention! Dirk Strider has attained the blessing of the Dark Dragon Primordial. Pandora Venatis. Await my word. Understood. Pandora slowly nodded, still processing what was happening. Dirk wasn't much better, and he looked questioningly toward Pandora. We, need to talk. I guess things are happening faster than I thought. You think? Pandora. There was a sudden shout, and the vampire queen flew over. Those below could only hear roars as the dark dragon spoke. But those nearby, such as the Vampire Queen, Pandora, and Dirk, heard all those words clearly. What was spoken by the Dark Dragon was beyond important. Such information, at first glance, involved the fate of the world. Both of you, come with me. Oh no you don't. Suddenly, another woman shot over. It was Cecilia, and she gazed threateningly at the Vampire Queen. He's not going anywhere without me. Your son has been spoken to by the Dark Dragon Primordial. We must dash. I don't care. If you want to speak with him, then I will be there as well. This information cannot dash. Mother. Let it be. Pandora shouted before Cecilia and her mother could argue further. With a scrunched face, the Vampire Queen glanced at Pandora before sighing. Fine. Come along. This discussion cannot wait. Saying that, she flew back into the ballroom. Duke Kyer followed, as did the other three. A small isolated meeting room with a single table. The vampire queen sat at the head of the table. Duke Kyer sat on her left, Pandora sat on her right. Dirk sat next to Pandora, and Cecilia sat next to him. Dirk. 
while they were sitting down, it was Pandora who spoke to him. She was quiet, but spoke openly. And she spoke in English. Don't say anything about primordial light, or the record talking to us. Why? It's one of my secrets. I have a stigma called the record of life that allows me to communicate with the light dragon primordial, otherwise known as the record. All right then. Dirk was unsure of how to respond to that bombshell of a secret. Communicating with the record itself? What kind of power was that? Dirk? Cecilia suddenly called his name. Everyone obviously had fantastic senses, so they could hear their words. Problem was, they couldn't understand the language. It was odd for these two to know an entire separate language when they had never met before tonight. In fact, from beginning to end, all interactions in the entire relationship between Dirk and Pandora were baffling to everyone. The two were supposed to be complete strangers, yet they had done so many odd things, the worst among them creating a blood pact. Dirk hesitantly glanced at his mother. He knew all these odd happenings warranted an explanation. And if it were anything else, even knowledge about his pure soul and eldritch primordial, he would tell her. But this, this was about his past life. It was too big of a secret. Give me a second, mother. Dirk said that as everyone stared at him and Pandora. Then, he started speaking in English again. How do we explain this? I'm debating about just telling them. That we're from another world? Dirk was a bit surprised. He didn't think Pandora, the deviously smart madwoman, would actually reveal such a big secret. She was someone who kept as many things to herself as possible, revealing information only when absolutely necessary. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that she trusted nobody. It took someone like that to do what she did on Earth. Pandora nodded calmly. Yes. It would answer many questions related to our abnormal natures. It would also raise even more questions, as well as decrease the trust these people have for us. It would make them skeptical, but it would make sense seeing as it's the only thing to explain why we're so familiar. But at the same time, it could threaten our lives. It would also make the situation even more confusing considering the recent declaration of war by the Dark Dragon Primordial. But, I think I know how to make it work. Your mother trusts and loves you, right? Pandora glanced at Dirk, who nodded rather quickly. They both trusted each other deeply. Good. My mother, the Vampire Queen, also loves me, so I'll use that. I want us to only tell our mothers about this. Keep that Duke Kyer out of this particular loop. He's the only loose end that could lead to unknown variables. If it's only our mothers, then we're safe. Can you do that? Yes. Then let's. Suddenly, Pandora turned to Duke Kyer. Duke Kyer. I have something that I wish to speak to my mother privately about. Cecilia Strider, your son also has something he wants to tell you privately. There's another room for you too just next door. So, Duke Kyer, if you could give us some privacy. The Duke, as well as Cecilia, looked at each other confusedly. After the Vampire Queen remained silent for a second, he stood and exited the room. Dirk also led his mother out of the room, entering another nearby. The two entered an identical isolated meeting room. What's this you need to tell me? Cecilia asked after the door closed. They didn't sit, instead standing next to the table. Dirk looked at his mother. He thought back to his life so far, all the abnormalities he displayed as a child. It would all be explained. But at the same time, his mother would know that he wasn't the person she thought he was. But he steeled himself. He trusted her. The reason Pandora and I know each other. Yes? I'm from another world. Dirk spit out the words, though with great difficulty. He felt odd just saying them. I used to live another life on another world. When I died there, I was reborn here, as your son, Dirk. Another world. Cecilia mumbled, spending some time to comprehend what he was saying. Eventually, things began to click in her brain. Dirk continued. I kept the memories of my previous life when I was reborn. So from the time I was a baby until now, I always remained, 
mentally at least, the person I was in my past life. I was always fully aware, and it wasn't long until I understood the language of this world. But I acted my age so as to not draw suspicion. Cecilia was silent for a while, slowly nodding. Gradually, she came to ask a question. Who, were you, in your past life? I was a soldier. Dirk spoke with a frown. He didn't like his memories from Earth. I wasn't a normal soldier either. I was something they called a super soldier. From the time I was a child, I was trained to be the most effective killer. Your parents dash. I didn't have any. At least, none that I knew of. I was an orphan who was abandoned, and picked up by the ones who create super soldiers. That sounds a lot like what Azura does. It's exactly what Azura does. Except my world didn't have magic. Anyway, I had lived that life of a soldier until I died. How old were you when you died? Cecilia asked this question, unsure of what to expect. If she were being honest with herself, this was a weird situation. But she was just taking it as it came. I was 18 years old when I died. I'm close to being the same age now as I was then. So I was an adult. Technically, my mental age is 34 years old. It's why I was so weird back then, as a child. I was always training, and since I was a soldier, I had skills I shouldn't have. And those people I killed during my dungeon dives. It wasn't difficult to kill them. I had done it easily, but I had been worried about what you thought of that. And when I was brought to Azure's Mountain, I was confident since I was trained to ignore pain. While I still had trouble, with the Emperor's help, I was able to get out. Dirk scratched his head. Back when he escaped Azura's mountain and learned about the Emperor who helped him, he had known then that his escape wasn't entirely by his own skill. It was Cecilia and the Emperor who gave him the chance. It allowed him to escape that hell, that which could hurt someone who could ignore pain by using magic and attacking their mind. Anyway, I guess I was never technically your child. Don't say that. Suddenly, Cecilia snapped. She grabbed Dirk's face, both gently and forcefully. She looked into his eyes. Don't ever say that again. Dirk, I don't care where you came from or who you used to be. You are my child. Do you understand that? Say yes, right now. Yes. Dirk couldn't help a small smile from surfacing. Seeing his stifled happiness, Cecilia pulled him in for a hug. It's weird, I'll admit that. She spoke with a whisper. It's weird to think that I gave birth to a young adult. I've been through many things, and this is by far the strangest. But. It means nothing in front of the bond we have. We've both grown. Neither of us are the same as we were back then. But through everything that's happened, I've always been your mother, and you'll always be my son. Past life or not. Call me greedy, but you're mine now and I'm not going to allow anything to change that. She separated with a smile, combing back his hair. Before he could respond, she tilted her head. Is this how you looked back then too? Because of magic, I actually look better than back then. Of course. But a world without magic. That's crazy. Anyway, tell me where Pandora fits into all of this. I'll assume the language you two spoke came from this other world because it surely doesn't come from here. Cecilia took a seat as she spoke, prompting Dirk to sit next to her. Yes. And Pandora was, she used to be an enemy, actually. We tried to kill each other on many occasions. In fact, we both died together, both our souls being taken to this world and reborn. Enemies? Then why are you so friendly? Or, I saw how you wanted to kill her, but that quickly changed. I did want to kill her when I saw her. But truth is, it was because of her that I was able to be reborn at all. I hold a little gratitude for that, and among other reasons, I no longer wish to kill her. And why did you make a blood pact? Because, well I'm not entirely sure. I don't think I can say that the situation was conducive to rational thinking. But either way, I suppose it represents our promise to work together. Those people from my old world, there's a chance that they may come here. 
Dirk explained the portal, how he and Pandora actually died by entering it and came to this world. She's been making preparations in the inevitable event that they recreate that portal and launch an invasion. And although this world has magic, the devastation they can wreak even without magic is astronomical. So I need to help her and prepare. But now, there's another reason to work with her. The Dark Dragon. Yes. I don't understand what happened there, but its words about war are comforting. Something is coming, and Pandora has certain secrets that make her aware of the oncoming crisis. That, combined with her intellect, make her someone worth working alongside. She's not an enemy, to me at least. And neither of us want to be each other's enemies. In fact, she really wants to support me. From our past lives, she knows what I'm capable of. All right. Cecilia nodded. She was beginning to understand the situation. And while she rethought all her memories with Dirk, it didn't change the fact that he was still her son. Most importantly though, Dirk had only been 18 years old when he died. He had lived an especially short life, without any parents, and forced to fight on the battlefield as a mere teen. When she thought about how he had basically repeated his past life when he was taken to Azure's mountain, she was heartbroken. But things were finally making sense now. And regardless of his past, he was still her child. Even with his past life, he had grown and become someone capable of telling her these secrets. There was no doubt of their bond as mother and son. So as far as she was concerned, this information didn't change much. But that also meant she needed to reevaluate Pandora. They had a serious relationship, and not the good kind. Unfortunately, Cecilia could only leave things to her child who knew Pandora best. It at least seemed like they were cooperating well, so far. There's something else I need to tell you, mother. What is it? Cecilia focused on Dirk who suddenly spoke again. After that, he went on to tell her about his special trait, his pure soul. He also told her about Eldritch Primordial and their hostility. That, combined with the Dark Dragon's words, made her understand several things. There was also the added detail of Azura knowing who Eldritch Primordial was. After that, Dirk told her about his other traits, such as adaptable genes and cybernetic enhancement. While he couldn't exactly explain the technology since he didn't know much about it himself, he was able to paraphrase and use metaphors to explain it. That gave her an idea of the things he was granted upon being born in this world. With that, Dirk had explained basically all he could. There wasn't anything else other than specific details he could tell her about himself. He had spilled every secret. Now, Cecilia truly knew who he was, inside and out. Of course, she was very happy with this. As she hugged him gleefully, Dirk suddenly saw something in his vision. Pandora Venatis is awaiting your return. It was the record that spoke directly to Dirk. He was unsure how to feel about that as he brought his mother out of the room and back into the main meeting room. Cecilia knew that Pandora had also spilled the beans to the vampire queen, so when she walked in, she and the queen glanced at each other with weird gazes. Pandora also looked at Dirk, a small smile on her face. She spoke in English. So how much did you say? Pretty much everything, other than detailed specifics. And you? I said enough. Dirk was quiet as he sat down beside Pandora. Cecilia sat with him, giving Pandora a weird glance. It was unbelievable that this girl had died together with her son, and she was reborn as the vampire queen's daughter. If Dirk was lucky, then she was graced by the gods themselves. Neither of the two mothers could say anything about speaking another language either. Both of them now knew the relationship between Dirk and Pandora. Once Duke Kyer walked back into the room, the vampire queen got back to business. We need to discuss what we do from here. Pandora? There's one thing that will determine what happens after tonight. It all depends on Duke Kyer and the will of Emperor Horizon. Pandora leaned forward, her red eyes gazing deep as Duke Kyer. Duke, or should I say, General Kyer. I want territory that leads straight to the Dwarven Haven. I have the armies to fight for it. Now, you haven't made any sort of concessions or attempted to negotiate for territorial rights at all. 
it leads me to believe that the emperor is willing to go to war over this particular slice of land. For what reason, I don't know, but it surely must be very important. So important that it will either result in every nearby empire becoming hostile with the Horizon Empire, or, it will result in the leaders of every empire becoming personally hostile with your emperor. There's a secret that he is personally hiding. Duke Kyer was silent, almost as if confirming her guesses. This didn't make her smile though. She maintained a cold stare. Your emperor isn't giving up. A secret of the world is being kept on the island in the center of the Central Sea. This involves people like my mother, and she will surely pay your emperor a visit sometime. So for now, I'll stay out of it. When you go back, tell your emperor this, I don't care about the secret he is hiding. I only want the territory. If he wants me to stay off that land bridge, then I'll do so. He can even monitor it, maybe station a small standing army there. I don't care. But I want that territory. With the secret on that island off the table, he'll surely be more open to negotiating. Maybe there won't need to be a war. Although, I am very much willing to begin one. Finally, Pandora smiled a bit. Dirk wanted to say that her madness was leaking a little, but he just kept silent. Duke Kyer had a mean gaze as she spoke again. Emperor Horizon has four days to give me a response. We either negotiate for the territory, or we fight. If I don't hear anything, or get a redundant, unsatisfactory response, then you'll hear from me again through the blades of my army. Then I guess there's no reason for us to remain here. Duke Kyer grumbled and stood. He had lost the discussion, but he was a general, so this didn't matter much. Still, he didn't like how cunning Pandora was. He saw her as a threat. Chapter 111 Advice the next morning, Duke Kyer and his people prepared to leave. But there was one who didn't go with them. You're staying? Cecilia worriedly asked her son, and Pandora smiled from beside him. Don't worry, Miss Strider. Your son is weak right now, and I intend to fix that. It's not his fault that he's not stronger. I know. I believe in your son's potential more than anybody, which is why I'm going to help him increase his tear. Cecilia frowned. It was only an hour before everyone was going to depart for Horizon, and he had just notified her of this sudden change of plans. And Dirk was the one who said he wanted to do this. She thought for a second, narrowing her eyes at Pandora. Then I'm staying. Hmm, very well. If you wish. Really? Cecilia was a bit surprised when Pandora easily agreed. She shrugged. I have no reason to keep you from staying. While there's the threat of war, and you might not be as comfortable as at home, you being here doesn't change much. If anything, it's good for us. Political hostages. Exactly. Your son will be the most well-treated political hostage in the world, though. Well, go tell your duke that you're staying. I don't intend to accommodate anyone else either. All right. Cecilia slowly nodded before approaching the Duke. Along with Riker and Alec's father, she explained that she was going to stay since Dirk was also staying. From the Duke's frown, it didn't seem he liked the idea. Unfortunately, Cecilia wasn't easily swayed. The two bantered back and forth, Riker getting involved as well. Alec made his way over to the side as they argued, leaning toward Dirk. You're staying? Yes. With her? Alec glanced at Pandora who was still hovering beside him. She smiled at him. You're Alec? Your light element is impressive. I can also sense fire. Why yes. You also have the light attribute then? Of course. Along with three others. You mean Dash. I'm the sole four attribute mage of the Dark Kingdom, Pandora Venatis. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Pandora curtsied a bit in introduction, causing Alec to gawk. Four attributes? Alec had only ever heard legends of four attribute mages. He didn't know they could exist. And if they did, they were the rarest existence in the world. And this princess was one of them. The sole four attribute mage of the Dark Kingdom. In this place, there were literally none other like her. 
Dirk stood to the side, not much of a reaction on his face. She had told him this the night before after their discussion with the Duke. Alec. Coming. Oh, and by the way. Before Alec left, he smacked Dirk in the shoulder with a cheeky smile. I win. Win what? Let's just say I didn't go back to my own room last night. Who? Dirk chortled at Alec's goofy grin, waving him off. Whatever, dude. Hey, don't be jealous. Oh, and you still owe me a fight. Find me when you come back to Horizon. Sure thing. With that, the two said their goodbyes, Alec jogging back to the group. Cecilia came back, standing by Dirk as they watched the envoys leave. He glanced at his mother. Were they mad? No. Just worried. About you or the political ramifications? H.M., a good question. Either way, they can't stop me, so I'm staying. And besides, you getting involved with Pandora is already a huge political scandal. That's true. Pandora chimed in with a smile. There was nothing she liked more than a bit of drama and chaos. Anyway, I hope you don't mind Miss Strider, but I need your son for a while. Your room remains the same, and if you need anything, I've assigned a maid to you. She'll be outside your room. And, for your empire's sake, I would refrain from making any suspicious moves during your stay. Or, at least getting caught while doing so. With a wink, Pandora linked arms with Dirk. Then, the two walked off into the city. Cecilia watched as they disappeared into the crowds. The world is very close to becoming a dumpster fire. Pandora suddenly spoke. The two had crossed into the Undercity through a special magic elevator designed for moving people and cargo through the weightless layer of limbo. After emerging, she spoke in English. I was alerted by the record only an hour or so ago. You know all the lesser dungeons around the world? Yeah. Well, they're all gone. Pandora dropped that bombshell, causing Dirk's eyebrows to raise. They all disappeared not long after the Dark Dragon made his declaration. There's something far worse happening as well though. Every single major dungeon has suddenly had an outbreak. Monsters are flooding from the dungeon entrances, and a few cities that were built around these dungeons have been razed to the ground. Not many people know about this, but according to the record, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Those monsters are incredibly powerful. If they aren't being contained, the world will fall into anarchy. Correct which is why things in every empire are about to change drastically. By the end of the day, militaries are going to be mobilized. At the same time though, one thing has just been guaranteed. The Horizon Empire can't go to war. Exactly. This gives me the chance to use the oncoming chaos to my advantage. Pandora giggled in glee. Suddenly, Dirk realized how she was able to do what she did in her past life. This mad genius was good at using chaos as a tool. Dirk still frowned though. Shouldn't you be working to help the Dark Kingdom? Depending on the scale of these dungeon outbreaks, millions could die. Are you really just worried about building some trains? Hey, who says the trains aren't going to help? If anything, my train network is going to allow combat personnel to be transported to any city within the Dark Kingdom at record rates. With this network, we can establish supply lines that would allow monster containment for years to come. On the contrary, empires like Horizon are only able to march troops or move caravans of wagons. It would take weeks just to respond to the current crisis. How much more damage do you think they will suffer compared to us who have the trains? They're going to be debilitated. Dirk was silent. Truly, the Horizon Empire wouldn't be able to respond at all except with local forces for the first few weeks of the outbreak. If the forces of a local city are overrun, then everyone in that city dies. But in the Dark Kingdom, Pandora could move troops to a city within days, potentially saving entire cities worth of people and allowing swift responses to this disaster. Essential goods could be sent across the Empire when needed and people could be evacuated the trains would become the most important piece of infrastructure the Empire had. And Pandora controlled all of them. Dirk was unsure of how to feel. 
on one hand, she was a mad genius who would take advantage of a global disaster. On the other, her work would actually save countless lives and keep her entire empire functioning. Pandora saw Dirk's conflict and smiled a bit, nudging him with her shoulder. Hey, don't worry so much. Right now, you only have one thing to focus on. While I have more to tell you, that can wait. Now come. Pandora led him into a building with those words. It was one of the largest buildings in the Undercity, towering upward around 140 meters. It looked almost like a pagoda with many floors. Upon entering, Pandora was greeted with reverence, even by those more powerful than her. She walked directly to the upper floors. With each successive floor, the spatial repulsion got stronger and stronger. At first Dirk could handle it fine, but when he was only halfway up, he had to activate his anima just to keep from collapsing. There's really only two kinds of training people endure in this building. First is controlling their dark element. Using dark mana, mages can negate the crushing gravity. This forces them to refine their control and it increases their elemental comprehension. Second is body refining. This is done by withstanding the gravity with the body, forcing people to efficiently use their anima and stress their limits. You will be doing both of these things, and I'll ensure you have the best environment available to you. Saying that, Pandora motioned to a room. The pagoda was 140 meters tall, and there was a floor every 5 meters. That made for 28 floors. The room she stopped at was on the 12th floor. And upon stepping into the room, Dirk was surprised to feel the oppressive gravity disappear. Not only that, he saw a large table with platters of food, a bowl full of mana crystals, and some large bones that glisten like pearls. Each room has magical switches to block the gravity. It ensures that nobody dies while training to their limits. Anyway, this will be your training room for the next while. You're going to remain here until you reach Tier 4. I would also prefer it if you reach rank 5 in this time, but I know it's good to take body refining slow. Pandora spoke as she walked to the table of food, picking up a fruit and taking a bite. Other than the table, there were two luxurious chairs and a nice bed. These furniture pieces were enchanted and constructed with metal frames, ensuring they could survive the intense gravity. They were surely extremely expensive. Now, before you get started and since we didn't do so last night, let's spill each other's secrets. I want to know your cultivation and refining techniques along with your skills. And go ahead and start eating. You'll need the food. Pandora took a seat on the couch as she spoke. After grabbing a few fruits filled with magical energy, Dirk took a chair, facing Pandora. I'll go first. She got comfortable, looking at Dirk's blindfolded face. I told you my four attributes, but not my specializations. Now, instead of speaking all our traits, skills, and crucially private information, I suggest we directly exchange profiles. How do we do that? My stigma. With your consent, I can view your profile. I'll also let you view mine. Like that, neither of us can hide information. Isn't that right, Miss Record? I will act as an impartial intermediary. Good. Pandora nodded as both of them heard Miss Record's voice. After thinking for a bit, Dirk sighed and agreed. Fine. Then take my hand. Pandora stood, as did Dirk. After he placed his hand on top of hers, she suddenly raised her other. In it appeared a brilliantly golden book with dragons engraved across its cover. The book flipped open and its pages fluttered automatically. Dirk then felt Pandora's gaze, and it pierced into his soul. At that moment, both of them became distinctly aware of each other's souls, though only for a moment. After a few more seconds, Dirk saw something pop up in his mind. Profile Name, Pandora Venatis Species, High Vampire Tier, 4+. Attributes Water 100%, Blood 100%, Earth 100%, Ice 100%, Air 100%, Vortex 100%, Light 100%. Traits, Pure Soul, Mind of Delirium. Skills, Eyes of Truth, Grade 7, 
Temptation, Grade 7, Synthesis, Grade 6, Purification, Grade 6. Stigma, The Record of Life. Dirk read through the profile. It was odd seeing any profile other than his. But he was surprised by what he saw. Powerful skills, a high tear, a high species, and all those attributes. Then there was the stigma that let her speak with the system, or more formally known as the record. Hmm, impressive. I'm surprised you actually retained your AI and cybernetics. As Dirk viewed hers, Pandora quickly viewed his. Profile. Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, 3. Rank, 4. Attributes, Fire 100%, Lightning 100%, Earth 100%, Metal 100%, Dark 100%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7, Mana Resonance, Grade 5, Mana Lungs, Grade 5, Restoration, Grade 5. Stigma, Black Cat of Calamity. Compared to Pandora's, Dirks didn't look like much. All this time, he had thought that his abilities were abnormal. Now, he was thinking that about Pandora's. Black Cat? Pandora tilted her head. At that moment, Spite appeared on Dirk's shoulder. She had remained hidden ever since Pandora appeared, except when appearing in the pistol form. Now though, she was showing her true form. Oh! Kitty! Hiss! Just as Pandora reached out to pet Spite, she hissed, and Pandora quickly retracted her hand. Spite shared most of Dirk's feelings and was wary of anything that could threaten him. Although they were working together, Spite didn't trust Pandora. Ah. Becoming downcast, Pandora drooped her head with a sigh, as if accepting something. When she raised her head, she was back to normal. Well, let me explain some of those skills and traits of mine. Pandora sat back down, her red eyes focused on Dirk. First, Mind of Delirium. Let's just say that if you dialed down my psychosis from Earth, this is what it would become. My mind is overactive. If your mind runs, then mine is a bullet train. It used to be annoying, but I have it under control now. The only time it isn't under control is when I get too excited, like when we first met. But otherwise, I can channel my overactivity into something that benefits me. Second, Eyes of Truth. This skill allows me to see through people. Depending on their power, I can see their profile with the help of my stigma, even without their consent. I can also see through almost all forms of mana and magic and I get an acute sense of the items I work with. I'll have you know that I'm an amazing alchemist. In fact, I received my synthesis and purification while working in alchemy. Synthesis allows me to combine chemicals and even different types of magic. Purification allows me to remove the things I don't want from any substance including metals, liquids, and air. As for temptation, you already know what that does. It makes people loyal to me. It makes them want to obey me and get close to me. I control them with their desires. If they fall for me hard enough, then they become a puppet in the palm of my hand. It's one of the reasons I was able to garner massive support for my projects. That and because they were successful and profitable. Finally, there's my stigma, the record of life. This does more than allow communication with Miss Record. It allows me to catalog and save spells for later study and use. It also allows me to transcribe runes when using my eyes of truth. Think of it as a book for all things magical. A grimoire, if you will. It's not an uncommon stigma for mages, but this one is the best because it comes directly from Miss Record herself. It's even better when I get her assistance in magical matters. Pandora ended with a high chin, proud of her abilities. After listening to her, Dirk was now realizing more and more how comprehensive her powers were. It was quite unsettling for Dirk to learn that her magical abilities were far above anything he had. She was definitely stronger than him. Her skills gave her an edge over anybody she met. She could fight someone above her tier, no doubt and Dirk was almost two tiers below her. Not even his rank matched up. Suddenly, 
being helped by Pandora felt irritating. Of course, Pandora saw Dirk's distress. She smiled when he suddenly stood up. I need to train. Of course, of course. I'll stick around though. I have plenty of advice that will help you, coming directly from experience. Who better to train you than someone with the same pure soul? Fine. Then let's start now. Very well. With a nod, Pandora stood and walked over to the table. There, she stood in front of a few bowls full of mana crystals. Each bowl held the mana of each of Dirk's attributes. While she didn't see his profile until just now, she was able to see the mana within him with her eyes of truth. She plucked out five mana crystals, crushing them all. Suddenly, the room was filled with dark, earth, metal, fire, and lightning mana. More than that, the mana that filled the room was like a liquid, far denser than anything Dirk had ever worked with. Be thankful, because these are the purest tier 5 mana crystals that my kingdom has produced. It's all liquid mana, so this should expedite the process of increasing your tier. Now, carry me through your mana cultivation technique. Pandora grabbed a chair and sat in front of Dirk. He gazed at her before waving his hand, bringing out a large book. It was the mana heart technique. She grabbed the book, merely looking at the cover for several seconds before nodding. All right. I understand. You read it. Eyes of Truth. She smirked before handing the book back. I didn't read all the runes within, but I understand where you're at and where you need to go now. You currently have three mini hearts comprised of each attribute and specialization. Now, you need to strengthen each heart until the mana within them is something like a liquid. Basically, you need to make it denser. For you, this couldn't be easier. I'll give it twelve days before you are tier four. Twelve days? Sounds a little fast. That's because you have no idea what having a pure soul means. Dirk, your soul is perfectly attuned to mana, and it's the strongest kind of soul there is. If I had rushed my advancements, then I could be a tier 6 already, let alone you becoming a tier 4. Basically, having a pure soul guarantees your advancement until tier 8. There are little to no roadblocks on that path. The only limiter is your elemental comprehension, and having a pure soul gives you the greatest advantage in that arena as well. So no, raising your tier by two small realms in 12 days is not fast. Being a mere tier 3 is actually a disgrace to your pure soul. Dirk was silent as she fervently lectured him. She then eased up and continued. Anyway, your next step is simple. Make your mana hearts liquid, and strengthen them until you reach tier 4. After that it becomes a bit more complicated, but we'll cross that bridge in two weeks. As for how to strengthen your hearts, you just need to bring in this dense ambient mana and concentrate it. Then, when you turn them liquid, there's a particular rune that you'll enchant the existing rune in your hearts with. That will complete the strengthening process. So concentrating mana is my job right now. Correct. Pandora nodded at Dirk's summarization. With that simple objective, he got comfortable in his seat and began. Pandora watched as the fire mana around Dirk was brought into his body and focused on his fire mana heart. When she saw this though, she frowned. No. Bring in all types of mana, and concentrate them all simultaneously. If you're not used to controlling all the elements at once, then now's the time to change that. All right. With a nod, Dirk proceeded to bring in all the mana around him. Then, he simultaneously concentrated the elements on their hearts. This did in fact prove to be difficult for Dirk, but he didn't complain. He just worked on it. While he wasn't going to blindly listen to Pandora, this was her advice as a genius four attribute mage. She absolutely knew more than him when it came to magic and cultivation. He wasn't so stubborn as to ignore her words. Chapter 112 Battle Over the next two weeks, the only thing Dirk did was condense the mana within his mana hearts. And with the liquid mana in the room, this was made extremely easy for him. It was both a gradual and quick process to strengthen his mana hearts. However, Dirk quickly encountered a roadblock. He had forgotten, but he couldn't control dark mana. Eldritch Primordial still didn't let him. 
so this meant Dirk had to do battle. After spending time condensing his other man hearts, Dirk attempted to cast his awareness into his soul. When he did this, he felt the dragon tattoo on his chest activate, and he was brought into the mana dimension. Dirk viewed the ocean of mana around him. Looking down, he could still see Eldritch lingering there, its eyes on his soul. He never left. Suddenly, Dirk smiled, approaching the edge of his domain. Eldritch narrowed its eyes. Bringing up his hands, the elements began to swirl around Dirk. I'm ready for another meal, squid. Looks like eternal pain isn't enough to make you learn. I should curse you instead. Suddenly, Eldritch shot out thousands of tentacles, each of them loaded with horrible power. Before the tentacles could curse Dirk's soul though, the tattoo lit up, and the dark dragon appeared around his soul. See me, you ugly squid. And accept your fate. Your source mana shall no longer be only yours to wield. With a roar, the tentacles were wiped out. Taking that chance, Dirk moved forward, intruding upon Eldritch's domain. And with the power of his soul and the ocean of elements around him, Dirk captured more territory. He burned his energy and usurped the dark mana. Along the way, Eldritch constantly attacked, but the dark dragon defended Dirk's soul. Like this, Dirk's initially 150 meter deep territory deepened. First it was 5 meters, then 10. Dirk fought to go deeper, closer to Eldritch. But Eldritch put up a tough fight. Dirk had to burn tons of his energy when he received the slightest attack in order to keep his soul from being cursed. Not even Dirk's soul, the strongest soul in the world, could keep up with the energy expenditure. And after a few hours of battle, Dirk retreated. The Dark Dragon stood at the edge of his domain, protecting his progress from Eldritch. 170 meters. He had only deepened another 20 meters. Not only did the difficulty rise as he got deeper, but Eldritch was putting up a far greater resistance. If not for the Dark Dragon, Dirk wouldn't go anywhere, merely being lured in by Eldritch and consumed when he got too deep. And it truly drained him to the core. When his consciousness returned to the real world, he directly passed out. Next thing he knew, he had woken up on the bed in the training room. Pandora sat beside his body. Oh, you're awake. You slept for eight hours. Care to explain? She looked at him with a curious gaze. He sighed as he massaged his throbbing head. You know Eldritch Primordial? The god of darkness, and the enemy of the dark dragon Primordial. Yeah. Well, that squid wants my soul, and he forever banished me from controlling the dark element. So if I want to increase the strength of my dark attribute, I need to fight Eldritch for possession over the dark element. How do you do that? Pandora was about to mention how absurd that idea was, fighting a god for possession over an element. But Dirk was serious, so she could only ask for specifics. When the dark dragon emerged. You heard him talk about Eldritch being near my soul. He also said something about source mana. Well, the dark dragon is helping me fight Eldritch. In the mana dimension, I trespass into the domain of that ugly god and take it, making it my own. The deeper I go, the more dark mana I have control over. Oh. I see. That's actually amazing. So that's what the dragon meant. Dirk, do you know what source mana is? She suddenly asked with gleaming eyes. Dirk obviously shook his head. Source mana is the source of all mana. People wonder, where does the endless mana in the atmosphere come from? No matter how many years pass or how much mana is consumed by the world's mages, it doesn't run out. The reason is due to source mana. Basically, source mana endlessly generates standard mana. This means that standard mana is unlimited. But source mana is not unlimited. There is a finite amount, and it is the most precious substance in the world. At the same time though, source mana cannot be consumed, and it is never destroyed. Anyway, the Dark Dragon wants you to take the source mana of Eldritch Primordial. In that way, you are fighting for control over the element itself. It's the only way for you to control the Dark Element since the God of the Dark Element doesn't wish for you to use it. While I'm not sure why the Dark Dragon wants you to gain such power, 
I don't believe it matters. You need to work on this. Pandora went deep into thought, and Dirk was a bit baffled. He didn't realize he was fighting for possession over such an important resource. Yet, now he knew the reason why he could endlessly regenerate his pool of dark mana. When it came to his other elements, he had to intake mana from the atmosphere with his mana lungs and regenerate his pool. But he couldn't do that with the dark element. Instead, it was the source mana he owned that generated it for him. As dots connected in his head, Pandora got excited. Suddenly, she dove at Dirk, tackling him on the bed. Click! As she got comfortable on his chest, she suddenly felt something hard press itself against her body. She snickered at his frowning face. Heh, not the hard object I was expecting. Get off. Not unless you don't want my help. What if I said I could fight with you to take that squid's domain? Miss Record, you there? After Dirk went silent, she flicked her finger. The next moment, the golden book, The Record of Life, appeared beside them on the bed. I am here. The record spoke. Riddle me this. Upon his departure, the dark dragon said that he would call down Sovereign Divine, the god of the light element. Dirk is also fighting Eldritch Primordial, the god of the dark element. The dark dragon said I would need to prepare. Both of you want the same things from us, though in the end, I'm not sure what that is. Are you catching my drift? You will be doing as Dirk Strider is. You will fight for the Source Man of Light, encroaching upon Sovereign Divine's power and making it your own. So I'm right. In that case, I have the perfect plan. Pandora's body shifted, getting more comfortable on top of Dirk. We can fight together against the gods. We have a unique bond between our pure souls, created by the serums we once consumed. In that case, when we enter the mana dimension as you call it, we can see each other. That means we can fight together. It'll be perfect. I can use my light element against Eldritch Primordial, and you can use your dark element against Sovereign Divine. It's the perfect way to grow stronger with the greatest speed. Maybe. Of course, we need to be in close proximity to do so, increasing the strength of our bond to its utmost. Not only does it feel good, but it provides benefits, so I suggest you get used to me sticking around. And the next time I get poked in the gut with a hard object, I hope it's not your gun. At least then I'll know you're happy to see me. She smiled as Dirk no longer jabbed his pistol into her side. After he grunted in annoyance, he pushed her off him. I'm fine with your plan, but I'm still tired. Once I recover, I'll attack Eldritch again. At that time I'll let you know. Mmm, very well. With their plans made, Dirk only had to wait to recover. It took longer than normal, but by the next day, he was ready to go. At that time, Pandora got comfortable with him on the bed. Dirk could only bear it before concentrating. Without much suspense, he cast his awareness to his soul, entering the mana dimension. He stood within his domain. At first, it was only himself that he saw. But after another few moments, Dirk saw a figure flicker into existence. It was a dark figure, another soul. The soul was gray, as if composed of fine ash and charcoal. It contrasted greatly with Dirk's golden soul. Gray soul of chaos. Dirk remembered the words spoken by the dark dragon and the record. Dirk had a golden soul of order, and Pandora had a gray soul of chaos. It looks like this was its true form. Whoa! Hey, you're so shiny. After Pandora had fully entered the mana dimension, she looked around. She saw Dirk and the dark dragon that guarded him. She approached. When she did, her soul made the light element around her flow like a river. Dirk could see it clearly, as if seeing it through her. This was their soul connection at work. Let's get started. Dirk didn't think too much before looking down. There floated Eldritch Primordial, as always. Pandora also saw him. Another pure soul. And one of chaos, yet wielding the light element. I should extend the same offer to you, to become my vessel of ultimate power. Eldritch's voice pierced into both their souls, grating against their minds. Pandora didn't frown though, 
only tilting her head at the squid below her. Become your vessel? No, that doesn't sound appealing. I know, why don't you become my vessel? You dare insult me with such an offer? Insult you? No, me offering this to you is a compliment. You know, I don't allow just anyone to become my underling. Even you barely qualify to become one of my tools. Insolent. With rage, Eldritch launched a series of attacks, all of them being blocked by the Dark Dragon. Dirk and Pandora descended. Dirk began fighting for the domain, but Pandora seemed to be thinking about something. Insolent? No, no I'm not unaware of your power. You really do only qualify to be a tool. Silence, wench. I am chaos incarnate. To even fathom the thought of using chaos as a tool shows your naivety. You are a disgrace to your pure soul of chaos. Excuse me? Pandora suddenly snapped, gritting her teeth. Shut your hole, you stupid squid. How stupid and ignorant do you have to be to not realize that chaos is something to manipulate? You think being a mindless savage gets you anywhere? You're nothing but a slave to your power. And that's why you're going to be stripped of everything. You don't deserve to be the god of chaos. No, you deserve to have your power taken and dominated. Chaos will be subdued. And, the perfect man for that job is right here. Pandora raised her head, looking at Dirk who was fighting for the domain. Suddenly, something clicked in her mind. So the dragons want us to dominate our opposites. But why? It's so much more difficult. I could control the dark element much easier than the light. But I don't have the attribute. Why does it have to be us? Miss Record, you're not telling me something, but I don't think it's out of malice. I think it's a trivial detail that won't affect the outcome. You're just hesitant. You're waiting. When Sovereign Divine comes down and we begin to take over the elements, I think you'll make your decision then. You'll place your bets when it's safe. My, so many secrets. Pandora! Dirk suddenly shouted, making Pandora snap out of her reverie. Oh! That's right, we're fighting a god. I should help. Please do! Dirk shouted as Pandora descended. And with her arrival, the light element lashed out in waves. It purified the darkness, pushing it away. Yet, when it touched Dirk's dark element, it merely washed over it. Something about Dirk's power, something about his soul, made the light element unwilling to stop his power. It liked him, though it was unfortunate that he didn't have the attribute. Nonetheless, the light element seemed to cooperate with Dirk, not just because Pandora was working with him, but because it liked his power. On the contrary, Pandora seemed a bit strained trying to control her element. Always such a drag. Hey, did you also have trouble controlling the dark element? Yes, actually. Dirk affirmed Pandora's thoughts. Both of them had ideas as to why now. Their souls were the opposites of their elements. How could controlling them be easy? Dirk had to dominate the otherwise chaotic darkness, while Pandora had to bend the orderly light element to her chaotic will. Neither wished to bow to incompatible hosts, but because they had pure souls, they could make do with sheer power. The two battled for a few hours. It was only a bit longer than before, but they had made much more progress. 200 meters. 30 more meters had been gained. For only a single battle, this was a fantastic harvest. After getting this far, the two retreated. They both returned to the real world, their breaths a bit labored. It truly took immense energy to battle like that. Pandora had to adapt to pure elemental manipulation, though it only took her a mere few minutes to figure it out. They looked at each other, Pandora resting atop Dirk's body. He frowned at how nice it felt, pushing her off of him. My reserves grow with every battle. I'm close to liquefying my dark mana heart. Maybe a couple more battles will bring you to tier 4 then. That's fine. Pandora nodded. At that point though, she rubbed her chin. You're also a body refiner. Your rank? Just became rank 4. Ouch. And your technique? Dirk took out his anima resonance destruction technique. 
with a glance, her eyes widened before nodding. This is perfect for you, and truly a fantastic technique. I've seen this before in our ancient records. The foundation of all anima techniques. Nobody knows who created it. Anyway, you're currently destroying your muscles, huh? All right, I'll be sure to grab some anima treasures for you tomorrow. How far along are you? What do your cycles look like? I've divided my muscles into 13 groups, and each group takes about two weeks to fully destroy and refine. I've barely destroyed a single muscle group. 26 weeks? That's quite a while. We should be able to speed that up. Pandora nodded with certainty in her words. Dirk titled his head. How? High density anima. When you use higher than normal densities, the body will heal with higher concentrations of anima, leading to better refinement efficiencies during each destruction cycle. How well are you able to use the advanced resonance technique? What's that? Pandora suddenly looked at him as if he were stupid. I really don't know what that is. It's the technique in your book. What, have you not read any of the runes in there? It's like the first runic section. I haven't. Ugh. It's like you're trying to sabotage your own growth. Pandora opened the book with a huff, pointing to the third runic page. This is the ability. It's the full version of your standard resonance technique and it's meant to handle higher density anima. Without it, you'll have issues controlling the higher densities leading to the anima scattering. But if you master it, it'll turn into an anima resonance skill. Now, along with battling Eldritch, your job is to read these runes. All right, all right. No. It's not all right. You should be so much more powerful than you are, and you don't even realize how slow you've been crawling. I get that body refining takes time and adaptation, but your tier is even lower than your rank. I know you said that it isn't your fault that you aren't more powerful, but seriously, what the hell happened that you're walking around with the strength of a child? Dirk went a bit silent. Along with his fatigue, his mood quickly turned downcast. Pandora quickly saw this change, along with the bubbling rage that seeped out a little from within him. She was a bit shocked. She always knew him as calm and rational, so this pure rage was new. I was taken, by a man named Azura. Chapter 113, Guns Dirk spilled everything that happened to him while at Azura's mountain. His two and a half years of hell, along with the horrible curse that sealed his eyes. Pandora was quite surprised. She couldn't help but reaffirm in her mind how unlucky Dirk was. To think he got kidnapped and trained to be a killer in two different lives. While it ended much better this time around, it was clear that he was deeply affected by Azura's torture. She didn't say much in comfort. There was nothing really to be said. At the same time though, she had her own complex thoughts. At some point, Pandora just left Dirk to recover, going about her own business. The next day, she revisited him, and the two battled Eldritch again. This time, they gained 20 meters, making Dirk's domain 220 meters deep. The day after, they came back and fought once more. But this time, they gained a mere 10 meters before Dirk stopped. Upon getting to 230 meters deep, Dirk felt changes in his dark mana heart. It had fully liquefied. When that happened, his entire soul shuddered. The mana hearts that filled the cavities in his soul suddenly expanded, and Dirk's mana hearts were voraciously consumed. When Dirk left the mana dimension, Pandora quickly followed. She saw as all the mana in the room was violently sucked away, filling his soul to the brim. This time, there was no such thing as running out of ambient mana. The cavities in his soul were easily filled all the way up. Enchant the rune. Pandora spoke at that moment. Dirk nodded, and while the mana hearts were being consumed, he formed a rune in his hands. It was the one in his book, and he had long since learned it. Like that, he enchanted each his mana hearts, combining them with the new rune and letting them sink into his soul. The mana hearts finally disappeared, and the surroundings became still. Dirk felt heavenly when his soul was able to consume all the mana it wanted. After a while, the mana hearts reappeared, beating with a grandeur that made Dirk's blood surge with elemental power. 
Pandora had to climb off of him as his skin began to burn with fire, even incinerating the bed under him. His body was that potent with mana at the moment. At some point though it came under control, and Dirk sat up. He was now a tier 4 mage. You should now have the mana pool equivalent of a low tier 5. Hmm. Dirk looked at Pandora with a bit of surprise. Was his mana pool really that big? She smiled at him. Your soul not only opens up the perfect advancement path for you, but gives you much larger energy reserves. The soul has infinite power, but mental energy is still connected to it in some way. So a better soul means you can manipulate more mana. Your mana pool could be said to be a reflection of this. So while you might not have the sheer power of a tier 5, you do have the reserves of 1. Alright. Anyway, advancing from now on will be quite a bit more difficult. The next step to increase your tier is to fuse your mana hearts into a singular and true mana heart. You'll be responsible for comprehending all the runes in your book because now they're indispensable to you. On the plus side, you can focus more on your body refining now. Okay. But how long will I be holed up here? You can't expect to just lock me in here to train day after day. Dirk sighed a bit. He hadn't left this room in over two weeks now. According to Pandora's words, the world was currently in utter chaos. Major dungeons across the empires had unleashed hordes of monsters, toppling cities, and requiring the response of entire armies. The hostility between the Horizon Empire and the Dark Kingdom had long been dropped, each empire needing to protect their own lands. But here Dirk was, being sheltered amidst all this anarchy. While he enjoyed increasing his tier so fast, he was tired of just condensing mana like a machine. Sure he could throw in sessions of runic comprehension, and his mana sight was being refined more and more, but he was still bored. I was actually planning on letting you out today. Not entirely because you don't need to train anymore. You're still a weakling. But because I talked to your mother, specifically about Azura and his fallen Azura assassin organization. Turns out, they're in my empire. Pandora spoke with a hint of anger. These assassins were trouble. She knew that there had been an organization in the shadows of her empire for a long time. She had even been able to collect immense amounts of intelligence on them. After all, she had once run such an organization herself, and on a scale the likes of this one couldn't fathom. It was only now that she connected them with this Azura Dirk spoke of. Your mother is willing to help weed out this scourge. And she wants to do it with you. So I had a few ideas. I've been silently collecting intelligence on them for a long while, and I have enough to take them out entirely. Now, I have you who can help me with this. I don't think there's anybody better to hunt down an organization than you. How about it, Mr. Super Soldier? Pandora smiled sweetly, though Dirk frowned at her words. Eventually, he just shook his head. Fine. Great. Come with me. Saying that, Pandora pulled Dirk along out of the room. They left the pagoda he had been in for two weeks, entering the streets of the Undercity. Before long, they had crossed into the Upper City. Pandora led Dirk to Cecilia's room in the spire. She was there, and Pandora pulled her along as well. Like that, the three exited the spire before making their way to an inconspicuous building in the outer city. It was a blacksmith shop, and Pandora subtly greeted the forge master there before entering the basement. Trains aren't all I've been developing in my time. Modern technology is too useful, so I used my influence to pull forge masters to my side and have them secretly develop various pieces of tech. While nobody is skilled enough to make anything like computer chips, certain other tools are easy. And with a bit of chemistry, I was able to make functioning prototypes. Entering a dark room, Pandora suddenly activated a light. When the room was lit, Dirk was stunned. Guns. They lined the walls, racks of them filling the room with the smell of steel. Dirk was baffled as he saw everything from rifles to pistols to rocket launchers. Every kind of weapon was here. Dirk felt something in him itch, his fingers twitching. He didn't like being a super soldier, but damn if he didn't love shooting guns. He had been ecstatic when he got his stigma, but that pistol could only fire magic. It wasn't a true gunpowder weapon. 
What is all this? Cecilia walked into the room, feeling the cold metal of the guns. Many looked like Dirk's stigma, but she didn't know what they did. Pandora smiled at her before glancing at Dirk. She could practically taste his uncontrollable desire to pick these weapons up. There's a range and plenty of ammunition. Go on. Hmm. Dirk nodded as he attempted to force down a wide smile. Stepping forward, he grabbed a rifle, stowing it before bringing it to a table with buckets of ammunition. Cecilia watched as he suddenly began to strip the weapon. With his fingers, he reflexively disassembled the rifle in mere seconds before putting it all back together just as quick. You remember these blueprints? Most of it. The rest was easy to fill in. Don't worry, it works exactly as you know. Pandora reassured him. With that, Dirk pulled out some magazines before loading bullets into them. In a minute, he stepped up to the range that was in the same room. With skilled motions, Dirk loaded a magazine and chambered around. There were targets at various distances. Cecilia just stood back and watched. She realized that this was technology from Dirk's world, so she was curious about how it worked. Bang! And she was shocked. After Dirk raised his barrel and pulled the trigger, she could see it. A small projectile that flew out of his gun with an ear-ringing explosion. She was able to follow it with her sharp senses as it spiraled through the air and through the paper target thirty meters away. But it wasn't a bullseye. Dirk frowned deeply while Pandora laughed. Ha ha. I think that's the first time you've ever missed. You really are rusty. Won't happen again. Dirk grumbled before pointing the rifle again. Of course his first shot wasn't on target. Not only had he not fired a gun in sixteen years, but he didn't have his eyes. He had to see everything through his man of vision. It wasn't perfect. But he didn't worry too much. That one shot told him everything he needed to know. With a flick of the thumb, the gun was set to automatic. Bang 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 bang. Cecilia's eyes widened as bullets rapidly flew out in succession. Shifting from target to target, Dirk sent five bullets through each bullseye before moving on to the next. When his magazine was empty, it dropped before he loaded a new one with scary skill. After ten magazines and three hundred rounds, Dirk had put dozens of rounds through every bullseye at every distance, the furthest target being one hundred and fifty meters away. Pandora grinned when she saw the bullseye of each target. In each one, there was a small smiley face formed from bullet holes. It was inhuman accuracy. Of course, this was what Dirk was known for, along with his absurd combat sense. Even Cecilia was shocked by his accuracy. She quickly grasped the function of the gun, seeing through its use. Such a weapon could give even ordinary people lethal power. But she knew it was also difficult to handle. It might not be as difficult as aiming a bow but it wasn't much easier. To achieve basically perfect accuracy with such a weapon proved Dirk's skill. Dirk was silent as the two women gazed at him. He looked at the rifle in his hands, feeling something within him resurface. Those blood-boiling memories of the battlefield. Clearing buildings, sending bullets through skulls with unfeeling accuracy. Killing targets from miles away with a sniper, watching those familiar puffs of pink mist. His gun was at the forefront of it all. Before he would have pushed down these memories. He didn't ever want to remember his days as a super soldier. But now, he smiled at them. He didn't ever want to be controlled or manipulated like that again. But that didn't mean he should forsake who he once was. He was a super soldier. He was a ruthless killer with the best senses and skill out of every monster to be created by Earth. He was feared by all who heard his name. His deployment meant that someone had signed their life away. His situation then had been bleak. But damn if his skill and renown weren't glorious. Why should he run away from his true self? He had a chance to take his instincts and turn them into something far greater. He was no longer limited, magic unlocking every shackle he didn't know he had. Up until now, he had barely used his full potential. He had pushed down all the memories from back then rejecting the person he had fought so hard to become. But now, it was like it all came flooding out. 
truly, guns were magical tools. Pandora almost couldn't stop a laugh from escaping her mouth. She knew something within Dirk just clicked. With her wide smile, she turned to Cecilia. Miss Cecilia, how about we show you just what a super soldier from another world is capable of? Lock the place down. Nobody is allowed to leave. Nobody enter that door. There was a particular building in the outer city beyond the floating city that was currently being surrounded. Guards swarmed the area, locking down the building and ensuring nobody interfered with their work. There were a great many curious spectators that hung around, wondering what was going on. Pandora led the way through the crowd, Dirk and Cecilia behind her. When a guard saw the princess, he saluted and shouted. Make way for Princess Pandora. Make way. The guards rushed to create a divide, though this proved to be unnecessary. Once everyone heard a princess had arrived, they parted automatically, their eyes full of reverence. Pandora strolled through with a smile, approaching the front of the building. Dirk walked behind, though he earned several curious gazes. He was in his armor with a rifle slung in front of him. There was a vest on his chest as well, holding six magazines and a pistol. Nobody in this world knew what a gun was, so they could only inspect his outfit with weird gazes. Princess Pandora. At ease, Captain. After approaching, Pandora scanned the two-story building while waving to the captain. He quickly gave a report. There are currently fourteen enemies within the building, and they have hostages. We weren't able to make any moves without guaranteeing the lives of the innocents. I understand. We'll handle it from here. Understood. The captain could only nod as he backed away. He didn't know what the princess had that could end this standoff safely, but he wasn't in a position to question. Dirk walked to Pandora's side at that moment, his grip adjusting on his rifle. You hear that? Fourteen enemies across two floors. And hostages. That's no problem for you. Let's see. Pandora rubbed her chin, thinking for a moment. I'll give you ten seconds to clear that building. It'll be done in eight. With a smirk, Dirk walked up to the closed door of the building. Cecilia walked over to Pandora at the same time. Eight seconds? How can he kill all the enemies in that short amount of time? Actually, eight seconds is a lot for him. I've seen him clear entire dozens of hostels in a mere three seconds. But he doesn't have what he did on Earth. Just watch. These are good shows. Pandora smiled brightly. At the same time, Dirk loaded his weapon, chambering around before walking to the side. He touched one of the walls a few meters from the door. What's he doing? It's never smart to just walk through the door. So the easiest way to get around that. Bang! Is to make your own. Pandora finished as Dirk blew down a portion of the wall. At that moment, the timer started. Dirk entered in with a large stride, following the flying debris. He sent out a mana pulse at the same time. In his mana vision, he could see eighteen people. Fourteen were hostiles, and four were being held hostage. The hostages were panicked as knives were pressed against their throats. Upon hearing the explosion, the enemies all turned to it. Before they could even face their enemy though, more explosions rang out. Bang! Dirk's gun fired eight times in the span of a mere second, his barrel sweeping across the room as his finger held down the trigger. From outside, Cecilia could see everything happening. For a moment, her heart clenched when she saw Dirk fire right at the heads of the hostages. She thought for a moment that Dirk didn't care about hostages. But then she watched as each bullet sailed right past their heads, entering the enemies behind them. She was a bit shocked when the next second ticked and all eight enemies dropped to the floor. Six more. Dirk mumbled. Then, he looked at the staircase that led to the second floor. He didn't rush up it though. Instead, he looked upward, shooting his hand out. Bang! There was another explosion with splintering wood. With a jump, Dirk shot through the new hole in the ceiling, his legs spreading out to catch himself. He didn't even have to send out a mana pulse this time. He already knew where his enemies were. And he was right behind them. 
As they all faced the staircase, the normal mode of entry, he aimed from behind. They couldn't even turn their heads before his finger twitched. Bang 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 bang. Six shots, and six thuds. The two hostages were frozen as the men holding them collapsed to the floor. Turning around, they saw Dirk looking at them through the iron sights of his gun. Clear. With that word, a long breath was released. Two seconds to sweep the first floor, two seconds to breach the ceiling, and two more seconds to sweep the second floor. He finished two seconds faster than expected. From outside, Pandora smiled and turned to the guard captain. It's done. Send some men to clean up and prepare the next raid. We're digging these guys up today. Understood. The guards saluted before some rushed in. As Cecilia watched them run in, her thoughts were both complex and impressed. From breaching the wall to breaching the ceiling, Dirk handled the raid with skill and ingenuity. Six seconds was all it took to sweep an entire building full of azures. There wasn't even a battle. More than that though, she was shocked by the power of the gun. She could sense the power levels of the enemies inside. The weakest were either tier or rank 3, while the boss was a low rank 5. While he didn't specialize in defense, that was still a rank 5. A single bullet was all it took to kill him. If those weapons were mass-produced, she couldn't fathom how powerful even an army of normal men would be. At that moment though, the two women were startled. Bang bang! Two more gunshots rang out, causing the guards to freeze. A few seconds later, Dirk finally exited the building, a frown on his face. What was that about? Pandora questioned him curiously. The boss, the strongest one. The bullet didn't pierce his head. I had to shoot another two before his skull gave out and he finally died. Really? But those rounds are armor-piercing for that reason. I guess I underestimated how tough rank fives are. Dirk was silent. He was the most shocked. He knew the rounds were armor-piercing, and he knew it was for good reason. Body refiners were tough. Dirk knew that when he finished his muscle destruction, a standard rifle round wouldn't be able to pierce his flesh. When he did bone destruction, he would be even more invulnerable to guns. In this world, guns were basically limited to killing high rank fours with relative ease. Even then, a bullet wound could be tanked by rank fours many times easier. It took a headshot. So Dirk had thought that these armor piercing rounds would be enough to pierce every skull, at least until rank six. But he was wrong. The boss skull could actually survive a shot with that round. It was atrocious, reminding Dirk once again that this was really a different world. Cecilia could see her son's conflict. But inwardly, she was shaking her head. This gun was a weapon that didn't use magic in the slightest. Nothing but technology. And yet, it could actually do so much damage. The mere existence of this weapon turned all magical logic on its head. Nothing like this has ever been seen before. And he was disappointed. Suddenly, Pandora turned to Cecilia. She could guess her thoughts, which is why she uttered a dangerous statement. Hey, Miss Cecilia, what do you think would happen if I were to produce a few hundred thousand of these guns? Chapter 114, Storm When Cecilia heard Pandora, she suddenly felt a shiver go down her spine. A few hundred thousand guns? That was more than enough to equip an army. She truly couldn't imagine the devastation they could cause with that kind of armament. They would be unstoppable unless the opposing army utilized rank 5s and SIXS. Suddenly, she was getting a glimpse at how dangerous Pandora was. She had the knowledge of their former world, a world filled with weapons and tools just like this gun. If she brought that here and equipped her empire with it, how powerful would they become? She already proved it was possible. It was just a matter of acting on it, something she could also do with her influence. Extremely dangerous. Cecilia narrowed her eyes, her evaluation of Pandora changing by the second. Then, she looked at Dirk. Surprisingly, he didn't react to her statement at all, as if it wasn't worth mentioning. Dirk returned his mother's gaze and shrugged. On our world, there were more guns than people. 
they were everywhere, equipped by every army. In fact, the weapons those nations utilized were far more powerful than this gun, many capable of wiping out thousands instantaneously. This thing is a child's toy compared to what I used. A child's toy. Cecilia couldn't help a right chuckle from escaping her mouth. That gun was a child's toy. More guns than people? Wiping out thousands in an instant? Cecilia only knew of the highest level magics that could compare with such feats of strength. But it was true. Dirk usually used railguns on his raids. He could call in airstrikes if necessary. He himself was the product of billions in investment. Earth was on another level compared to this place. And everything was mass producible. Of course, it would take at least decades to bring that level of industry to this world, so Pandora couldn't do it immediately. But she could do so on smaller scales. Wasn't she already laying down railways? She even had these prototype guns. She had an entire arsenal sitting in a basement. That meant they could be made, and none of it was difficult to produce. It didn't take powerful magical ores, only some steel forging and chemistry. Dirk didn't doubt that given enough time, she could produce millions of guns. Granted, such an arsenal would be enough to instantly shift the world's power balance, but that was beside the point. Seeing Cecilia's concern, Pandora just chuckled. Let's not worry about that for now. Come, we have many more hideouts to raid. I want these Azuras out of my city by nightfall. And I've got them all lined up on a chopping block. With a sinister smile, Pandora led the two away. Like that, Dirk relished in the familiar bloodshed, recalling his memories in a more pleasant light than usual. For the rest of that day, Pandora led Dirk and his mother around the city. They bounced from building to building, raiding them just like the first. Of course, all of the raids fell on Dirk's hands. But he was more than fine with this. Each time he swept through floors, sailing bullets through skulls, often right by the heads of hostages. It was exhilarating. Upon coming to this world, half of Dirk's combat power came in a form that he wasn't used to using. He actually had to learn magic, and he often relied on his body anyway. If it weren't for body refining, he would have a much harder time fighting the people of this world despite his magical talent. But this? This is exactly what he was good at. It was like he was scratching an itch that he didn't know was there. His body seemed to remember everything from his past life despite never having done any of this. It was so ingrained into his soul that it came naturally. It was why after firing a single shot, Dirk never missed again. In fact, he was actually advantaged without his eyes. His mana sense was effectively 360-degree vision, so he could cue his actions further ahead of time by capturing everything around him at once. And his mana pulses allowed him to get reliable glimpses at enemy positions before entering buildings. These things compensated for his lack of technology and gadgets. Compared to before, Dirk's ruthless skill was finally showing to its fullest. Something within him really did click. Everything that he used to be on Earth came rushing back to him. He had rejected the person he used to be before. He never wanted to return to the time when he was used like a dog before being disposed of. So he pushed all that away. But he was seeing it differently now. He was accepting the person he used to be. He was naive back then, but he was better now. All his flaws back then were mental, and being a super soldier wasn't synonymous with being a dog. Now, he could accept that person, because he knew that he wouldn't allow himself to repeat those mistakes. He accepted the super soldier within him in all its glory. It was odd though, how shooting a gun could break down one of his barriers. Truly, they were magical tools. By the time the sun set, Dirk had finished the last building. He walked out as guards rushed in, locking gazes with Pandora. His mana vision was even sharper than it was a day ago, and now, he truly could see things with black and white vision. He could even see into the distance, able to take in the image of the floating city and all its magnificence. While he missed the colors of the world, this was better than nothing. I think today was a good day. Pandora smiled as she looked at Dirk. When he went to raid buildings, he flipped a switch, and she had flashbacks to the super soldier she knew and loved. 
well, not loved, but hated. But that was different now. Pandora sensed Dirk's changes, but more than that, she sensed how he really had changed from back then. The super soldier in him only knew how to kill with apathy. Now, this new man knew how to smile and have fun. She could sense his glee, and over time, she was understanding the drastic changes to his psyche. It wasn't that he became more normal, just more open to others. She only knew a single person he could do that with before, and that was Gray, his sergeant. To all others, he was cold and callous, capable of unflinchingly killing them at any time no matter who they were. Truly, there wasn't anybody he had even the thought of caring for back then. And that was so different now. She almost couldn't recognize him. Then again, she couldn't even recognize herself. He wasn't the only one who had changed. Cecilia ruffled Dirk's hair when he approached. In fact, those raids hadn't all gone super smoothly. There were a few times when Dirk encountered an enemy he couldn't immediately shoot to death. One of them was a rank 7, and Cecilia had to step in and kill them. And she did so with ease, shocking even Pandora. A rank 7 enemy was someone who could devastate an entire city. That person was probably the one who was running all the operations within the capital, or at least right near the top. But Cecilia had shown a glimpse of who she was after she managed to kill them without so much as a sound. The only thing Dirk had felt was an abyssal surge of darkness before it faded back to normal, revealing a severed head and his mother who carried it by the hair. Well, if it were against anybody other than the most powerful in this world, Dirk was sure his mother would never lose. And Cecilia was more than happy to go through the trouble. These were the azures she so hated. The less there were, the happier she was. Of course, the ones they killed were also only in the capital city. There was no doubt that these azures were strewn throughout the Dark Kingdom. But at the very least, they suffered a significant blow in this single day. Pandora's intelligence gathering skills were fantastic. With that, they returned to the floating city. Before separating, Pandora turned to Dirk. I've got many things to take care of, but we won't be staying here forever. The world really has been thrown into chaos with the dungeon outbreaks. Over the last two weeks, three of our cities have been obliterated, and at least two million have died. This is just in our empire. Anyway, my trains are running constantly, and we're constantly laying down more railroads. Now more than ever we need to implement this technology, and although I plan to wait, those guns will eventually equip our armies. Anyway, I'm giving myself another two weeks. After that, we're leaving. Our destination will be the Dwarven Haven, so prepare yourself for a long trip. Until then, sharpen your magic, read some runes, and do some forging. I already know we've got a long road ahead of us. Pandora was a bit solemn as she gazed at him. After he nodded, they finally separated. Dirk returned to his room after talking with his mother a bit. Come night, he did his destruction cycle for the day. He began doing them before bed so as to minimize the time he was weak. Doing it before sleeping worked well, even boosted recovery a bit. Before Dirk could go to sleep though, his door suddenly opened. He looked over, his pistol appearing in his hand by reflex. When Pandora appeared, she smirked at him. You really like to wave that around. Do you ever feel safe? When I have my gun, yes. H.M. She hummed before closing the door behind her, making her way over to his bed and getting comfortable next to him. Just as he was about to scoot away, she opened her mouth. I talked to Miss Record. We have a mission. Dirk froze a bit, no longer scooting away. She spoke softly. This war cataclysma. You could say it's a war over the elements, between the dragons and gods. Battling for the source man of the elements is the key to this war, and now, neither side will stop until the other is eradicated. On the plus side, we're now being roped into the center of this conflict. How is that a plus? Dirk looked at her stupidly, to which she rolled her eyes. Because with chaos and conflict comes opportunity, you dork. War makes people rich and powerful. And as those in the center of it all, we're going to be the richest and most powerful. So long as we don't die first. Anyway, 
I've received our first mission. Miss Record says that there are six items that are crucial to the outcome of this war. They're called the sources, and you could say that they are the keys to the elements. If you control the source, you effectively control the entire element. Naturally, something like that would make you a god, so it's beyond us right now. But what isn't beyond us are things called key artifacts. These are apparently the keys to the sources, necessary to wield their power. We need to find each of the keys and take them. Unfortunately, this just got extremely difficult due to the fact that all the dungeons have exploded with monsters. And, the keys are located near the ancient lairs. At the very least, we'll need to travel to all corners of the world just to get our chances at finding them. Travel? Dirk asked with a raised brow. Where are these ancient lairs? Each of the major empires holds control over them. We have the ancient lair of darkness, Horizon has the ancient lair of fire, Dwarven Haven has the lair of earth, Unity has the lair of water, World Tree has the lair of air. As for the lair of light, nobody knows. It's speculated that the fairies control it. Not that I know who the fairies are, but okay. Well, we're already on top of the first lair. Where is the key? I don't know. Miss Record? Pandora suddenly took out her book of life. I'm here. Where's the key artifact of darkness? There's no key artifact of darkness. Why not? Because unlike the four main elemental sources, the source of dark and light remain in the control of the gods. A key has never been created for that which was never in our control. Interesting. Pandora nodded with a thoughtful face. Turns out that the dragons created the key artifacts, and they had control over the four main elemental sources at some point. By the same point. The record suddenly spoke again. A key must be created for the sources of dark and light in order to wield them. Primordial darkness has created his own artifact, but it is incomplete. I have also created one. And where are these incomplete artifacts? The book of life in your hands is mine. The record spoke as a matter of factly, surprising Pandora a bit. As for primordial darkness artifact, I am not sure. You will need to gain his approval in order to wield such a thing. Unlike my artifact, that built of chaos cannot be wielded by the weak, nor can the other four elements. You do not meet the necessary standard, Dirk Strider. But then how are we supposed to take the other key artifacts if we can't wield them? Pandora questioned. If these artifacts were too powerful to wield, then what was the point in grabbing them now? The key artifacts of the four main elements are indeed too powerful for you to fully wield, which is why there are seals built into them. You will understand when you attain the first one. Then I guess we can only trust you. Pandora let out a light breath, moving her body to lay down comfortably in Dirk's bed. She thought for a few seconds, rapidly formulating plans in her mind. Our schedule is unchanged then. We're going to move straight to the Dwarven Haven. Why there? Why not Horizon? Two reasons. Pandora put up two fingers, poking Dirk's chest with them. First, I have business in the Haven. The dwarves want a supply line between us. It was the original purpose of the war that never happened, and now that we've negotiated with Horizon, we are green to begin building. Once I get there, of course. Second, there's no way we're getting near the ancient lair of fire. This is especially so since Horizon still doesn't trust us, me especially. I'm not taking all that time just to walk into a fiery wasteland and get kicked out by the Emperor. We need more power first. So, that leaves the Haven as our first stop. Pandora explained simply. To this, Dirk could only nod. It wasn't like he had his own direction, so he could only follow along. So. Pandora suddenly clapped, jumping off of Dirk's bed. Two weeks until we leave. I'm settling logistics before then and making sure we have a way out of the city. You get to sit tight and get used to your magic until then. As for your mother, explain to her that she can't come with us on our expedition. Why not? Dirk asked hesitantly. He trusted his mother more than anyone at this point, and her power was a great reassurance. Pandora chuckled a bit. Are you really that much of a mommy's boy? 
Your mother is powerful, but she can't be there to solve all of your problems. Besides, I know she'll be needed in Horizon. That place is in definite chaos. Plus, your mother wants to hunt Azura. She can't do that when she's constantly looking out for you. Both of you need to let go of each other for a bit. I don't care how you need to say it, you need to tell her to go elsewhere. Dirk was silent for a bit, a small embarrassed frown on his face. At some point, he just sighed. Fine. Good. Plus, this is our war to fight, Dirk. These key artifacts will be ours. Miss Record might still be hesitant to place all her bets, but as soon as she gave me the information she did, she no longer held control over the outcome of this war. She signed over everything to us. We're not just little pawns in this grand scheme. As far as I'm concerned, our future is going to dictate the rise or fall of the dragons and gods. I refuse to allow anything otherwise. Dirk looked over, seeing Pandora's wide, red eyes. They glimmered with the madness deep within her, the madness that sought an odd type of control. Unlike Dirk who controlled through patterns and force, she controlled through chaos. Through the chaos of war and uncertainty, she led others like a puppet master. Dirk knew what she was willing to do to get what she wanted. This woman had no inhibitions, and the fact that she could now guide her madness made her all the more terrifying. Unconsciously, Dirk found himself straightening up. His muscles entered a state of being taut yet relaxed. His mind sharpened as he made himself resolute. Dirk didn't know exactly why he was going to fight this war with her. He didn't have some lofty goal like saving the world. He still thought it impossible, unlike the endlessly ambitious Pandora. But he did know two things. One, he wouldn't allow himself to be weak. Ever since he forged himself through Azura's hell, he abhorred the very idea of weakness. He would reject anything that made him weak, and he would do all he could to become stronger. He wasn't gaining strength for the sake of something or someone else, not for his mother or Ava. No, he was gaining strength to reject all notions of weakness. If he wasn't the absolute strongest he could be, then he would stop at nothing to reach the pinnacle of what he could become. Only then would he finally have the control he wanted. And if the pinnacle wasn't enough, he'd fight until he died. He could rest then. On the other hand, Dirk was uneasy when he thought about Pandora running around the world doing whatever she wanted. Perhaps for the sake of the world, he had to do the only ethical thing he could and keep an eye on her. Otherwise, this mad woman could very well bring about the end of this world that was already descending into an apocalypse. He was pretty sure only he could act as some sort of leash. With that, Dirk's mind was resolute. That night, one mad woman and one soldier made their vows to the world. It wasn't long before they would enter the storms of this war cataclysma. Chapter 115, Rook Class I'm sorry. No, I understand. Cecilia sighed, wiping the frown off her face. Dirk had, with great effort, come to her and informed her that she wasn't welcome on the expedition. He explained using Pandora's words that this was their battle to fight since they were now what could only be described as envoys of the primordial dragons. Of course, Dirk beat around the bush a lot, not wishing to make his mother upset or sad. But Cecilia knew what was going on, and she easily saw through the situation. And while she really didn't want to leave Dirk's side, she knew she couldn't guard him forever. It wasn't feasible nor good for his growth. She knew Dirk had amazing talent, and she herself had gotten strong through a lifetime's worth of adventures, battles, and hardships. If Dirk were anyone else, even one of her other children, then Cecilia would be more callous. She'd say that they needed to leave the nest and discipline themselves with experience and adversity. She'd actively send them on their way to go and fight in dungeons, building their skill and power. And in fact, she had done that with her two daughters, Viola and Rita. It was why Dirk never saw much of them, even when he was still at the academy. Ethan was the only one who joined the military of his own volition, and since then, had been working there while Riker taught him all kinds of skills and tactics. But Dirk was a special case, even more so now that he revealed his secret to her. He was already disciplined, more than even his past life, and he had a hardened mind far beyond any warrior. 
Cecilia's other children, despite being older, couldn't compare to his experiences. In short, Dirk was already a ruthless killing machine with everything he needed to grow. He just had to build up to his vast potential. And he couldn't do that if Cecilia were hovering over him. While she wasn't fond of Pandora, she trusted in Dirk's judgment. He could handle himself. So she agreed to take a step back. Well, it won't be a completely bad decision either. I can focus on hunting Azura, though I'm sad I won't be able to do it with you. Not necessarily. Dirk smiled a bit. Just because I'm traveling doesn't mean I can't keep my eye out. I'll find anything I can, and I'll kill every Azura I come across. Maybe if they're there, I can clear out the dwarven haven of Azuras. Mm, that's very true. My, such a good child. I'm proud of you, sweetie. Cecilia couldn't help a wide smile, wrapping Dirk up in a big hug. Dirk just laughed. He was sure there was no other mother in the world who would praise their child for hunting people like pigs. Hmm, well, I don't have to leave immediately. You said Pandora gave you two more weeks? I'll help you with your spells and anima techniques until then. Your power has grown significantly in a short time, and your skills are lacking. Given two weeks, you should be able to heavily refine the magical tools at your disposal. Sure. I really could use your help too. Dirk readily agreed. He had never been able to truly refine his spells and techniques. There had always been a distraction or something to do. So while two weeks wasn't a long time, if he spent every waking hour training, then he could benefit immensely. Then it's settled. Come, we'll start right now. You had a training room, right? We'll use it. For the next two weeks, I'm going to squeeze out every bit of short-term potential you have. You'll surpass anybody at your tier, that much I'll guarantee. I dare say you'll be able to kill tier fives. I look forward to it. Dirk had a wide smile as he nodded. After that, he and his mother made their way to the training room Dirk had occupied for a couple weeks prior. That's your void walking? Yes. Ouch. Cecilia's beautiful face cringed at Dirk's use of the dark movement spell. While she didn't blame him for his lack of skill, she truly had a hard time looking at such a butchery of spell usage. Then again, you did silent cast exceptionally quick. In terms of sheer power and magical prowess, you actually have a strong foundation. You just don't know how to channel that brutish power properly. You're also using a disgraceful knockoff of the actual spell. I'll teach you the actual spell. Actually, I already know the actual spell. You do? Hmm. I've traced all the runes from the original magical text. Traced? Cecilia tilted her head, prompting an explanation. One of Spite's abilities. With my help, we can trace any runes we see and she can store them permanently in my mind. Before I was taken, I had traced many of the runes from the original Void Walking text, along with runes for Curse of Darkness and Theory of Stealth. I can go back and comprehend these runes anytime I want in my head. That's so not fair. After being stunned, Cecilia could only mumble those words. How amazing was it to just look at runes and forever remember their structure? And then you could go back and comprehend them anytime you wanted. That took away almost all the value from magical texts. It was an amazing ability that defied common sense. Cecilia sighed. Oh well. If you know the spell, then I'll start training you with it. You can easily match a tier 5 in sheer power, so you can begin training the spell. Even Rita could begin learning the spell at tier 4. Then again, she was almost tier 5. But that doesn't matter. She waved her hand. Then, she stood. Watch me. Saying that, Cecilia disappeared under Dirk's gaze. He could sense the dark man around him fluctuate as her body shuttled through the void. Her movement was slow, and the mana fluctuations obvious, but that was so Dirk could learn. He watched as she flew about the room, going from one corner to another in seconds. Dirk just sat there, watching her movement through space. And Dirk was astonished. It was like he could see ripples in reality as she drifted by. 
At its core, void walking was a movement technique based in space. It warped the space around the body to move you across distances at insane speeds. The only thing that could match a dark mage in distance traversal was a light mage who utilized the unfathomable speed of light itself. No other element took things to the same extremes. But he was also confused. Void walking, in order to move a person's body, had to connect to two points in space, the mage's current position and their destination. At higher levels, they could move through obstacles, even teleporting vast distances. What Dirk couldn't understand was the instantaneous movement from one point to another. What happened in between? How did the person just vanish? To fill in those gaps in knowledge, he began to theorize. And Dirk's theories didn't involve spells. As Dirk had fought for control over source mana, he was now used to using dark mana directly, not with spell formations. He manipulated the element when using his stealth technique and mana pulses. Even as crude applications of void walking happen using silent casting, a form of elemental manipulation. Of course, since he wasn't proficient in the actual void walking spell, he would have to start with forming the runes. But he didn't imagine things using spells as the basis. He was always thinking in terms of direct manipulation. He felt the dark mana within him, communicating with the element directly and wondering how to control it like his mother. And he got plenty of chances to test things out. Cecilia was serious about training Dirk. She wanted to prepare him as much as possible, arming him with the best magical knowledge she could. As Void Walking was considered one of the most important spells to any dark mage, she intended to focus on it the most. After all, it was a life-saving technique that could get Dirk out of sticky situations and put him into advantageous ones. So they trained incessantly. Gradually, Dirk began to refine his spell. Only, as he practiced more and more, Cecilia noticed him deviating heavily from the intended effects of the spell. Do it again. Cecilia spoke as she sat in a chair. Dirk stood in front of her. His head was throbbing from the constant spellcasting, but he disregarded the pain and did as she said. He faced empty space, and the spell formed in his mind. Cecilia watched as Dirk's dark mana extended through space, making contact with a point about five meters away from him. Then, something odd happened. His body actually distorted, appearing simultaneously at his original position and at the destination. There were two of him. Of course, this distortion was only momentary. In the next instant, Dirk appeared fully on the other side. In an attempt to bridge the unknown gap of teleportation, Dirk had resorted to creating something of a spatial channel. Like that, he would distort his position in space, making his position his destination by overlapping them. So for a moment, he would appear in both places at once. Cecilia naturally saw what he was doing but because it was such an odd application of spatial movement, she wasn't sure what to say. Despite you making the spatial channel, it doesn't create an obvious weakness. While any dark mage near the tier 6 realm could disturb your movement, because you also aren't exactly moving through space, it wouldn't backfire on you. But there isn't any shock factor. Indeed. Cecilia nodded at his conjecture. Void walking was supposed to be instant. In one moment, you were at point A. The next moment, you were at point B. On the other hand, Dirk's void walking placed him in both places at once. While it could happen just as fast as normal teleportation, it also made his destination incredibly obvious. For a small window, he would be seen in both places. Anybody with good mana senses could pick up on this, removing the element of surprise from his movement. Well, it's a start. Let's keep working on it. And start showing me your other techniques. I can't help you when it comes to fire or lightning, but I'm also an earth mage. I can show you things like earth guard along with some ground shifting spells. Granted, I'm only a tier 6 earth mage in terms of power, but my skills and experience are there. Hmm. I'll take anything you can give me. Dirk didn't hesitate to accept her help. He forgot but she was indeed an earth mage. But because she was such an amazing body refiner and dark mage, her earth spells never saw much use, being overshadowed. All right. 
let's switch to controlling your aura. We've got six more hours in the day. You'll have no trouble sleeping by the end of it. Across two more weeks, Cecilia did what could only be described as standardizing Dirk's spells and techniques. Dirk had thrown together his techniques crudely so he could use them in his escape from Azura's Mountain. The theory of stealth text didn't actually have any spell formations, only runic formations to comprehend. Thus, Dirk had to toss together his own techniques based on his shallow magical experience, creating his stealth technique. Of course, for a person at Dirk's level, it was shocking enough to put together any stealth technique at all. Cecilia had long been surprised by his inherent ability. Sure he fell behind Pandora, but his sheer ability was no lesser. This was especially true when he practiced with his stigma, the pistol. Dirk had developed spells to use as elemental substitutes for bullets. Cecilia took a look at this too, giving him a great breadth of advice that sharpened the spells further. Metal bullets, fire bullets, even dark bullets imbued with curses. Dirk refined his unique spells and made them far more efficient and powerful than before. Now, they were a powerful weapon he could use at any time. Bullet spells, stealth, mana pulse, mana vision, earth guard, void walking, plus a myriad of other auxiliary spells. These were all the magical tools at Dirk's disposal. Over two weeks, Cecilia refined every one of them, and Dirk was exceptionally malleable to her corrections. They were all brought to a new level under her guidance. But only half the time spent training was devoted to magic. When Dirk drained his mental energy, they would always switch to anima training. Dirk's physical body didn't need any training. He had long reached the peak of physical strength, agility, and dexterity with his body. Anima was miraculous in that he didn't lose progress even after a long time of no training. So for a long time now, Dirk only needed to focus on two things. His destruction cycles were easy. It was just a tedious process of hurting and healing. On the other hand, his new aura ability wasn't so easily controlled. Dirk was currently a knight-class warrior, someone who could channel their anima out of their body and create aura. The most a knight could do is eject their anima from their body, creating an uncontrolled explosion of anima that did nothing but destroy material. It was crude, but still powerful. Normally, it took a powerful and skilled rank 4 to actually create aura. Only rank 5s could even think of refining their aura. Dirk had already begun to refine his aura. Before leaving for the Dark Kingdom, his mother had trained him on the basics of becoming a rook class. Now, he was once again compounding off that progress, going even further. Here. Cecilia tossed a knife into the air. Dirk caught it without much thought. Don't think of anima as much different from the elements. Anima can still be comprehended, and you can learn about the special attributes that it holds secret. This is how you can fill material with it and yet not destroy it. Many think anima is simpler than mana, but that couldn't be more false. Only meatheads think that, and there are too many meatheads who train anima. Control anima like you do mana, and concentrate it. Dirk gazed at the knife as his mother explained. The knife was nothing more than a cutting knife for bread. Cecilia had been challenging Dirk with infusing his anima into weapons. The challenge was to not destroy them in the process. This went against what anima was as a naturally destructive material. But Cecilia also had Dirk question the nature of anima. It wasn't purely destructive, otherwise everyone would be dead since anima existed in the atmosphere alongside mana. Instead, anima could be both destructive yet protective. It was like how mana could reinforce things through enchanting and yet destroy through spells. The process of body refining was adapting the body to dense anima, taking advantage of the reinforcement anima could provide. Dirk learned to tap into this. You don't want to destroy the knife. Cecilia mumbled as Dirk channeled his anima. His dark gold aura streamed into the handle. And her eyes lit up. Previously, Dirk could only use his aura explosively, releasing it into the knife with violent force. Now, it was slow and steady. She watched as the handle was subject to a phenomenon similar to corrosion or decay. This was Anima's destructive power. 
when the aura reached the blade, the metal also began to see tiny specks of brown appear. It was rust. But Dirk kept going. He felt the anima and how it interacted with the material around them. Suddenly, he thought of something. If the atmospheric anima doesn't harm anything, then should I just use it like that? Dirk's mumblings reached Cecilia's ears. She froze for a moment before concentrating on the knife. It was then that the dark gold aura filled the knife. When it did, it suddenly froze. The blade stopped rusting, the handle stopped decaying. I don't want to resonate it. Anima resonation would destroy materials. Dirk didn't want that. So he brought the anima to a standstill, wrapping the blade in his aura. A thin film of dark gold coated the silver bread cutter. Cut this. Suddenly, Cecilia held out another knife. Dirk waved his hand. Shing! Clang! A blade of metal fell to the ground, separated from its handle. Cecilia's smile was wide, tossing the handle in her hand away. You did it! Yes! Ha ha ha! I'm so proud of you! Cecilia couldn't help herself as she clapped and scooped Dirk up in a hug. Despite Dirk being taller, she easily swung him around with her atrocious strength. The indicator of a rook class, being able to imbue, reinforce, and enhance weapons with aura without destroying them. Dirk was a rook class. Ha ha. Wait, don't stop now. Continue. Do it again. After instantly calming her excitement, Cecilia had Dirk repeat the process. The result was another cut blade. His aura was so sharp it could slice through metal like butter. And now release it. Release aura from your blade. Hmm. Dirk frowned for a moment before swinging his knife. As he did so, the tip of the knife released a line of aura which shot out. Upon colliding with the hard floor, it only left a slight cut before dissipating. Cecilia trembled in excitement, more thrilled about this success than Dirk himself. Amazing! A rook class. And you're only rank four. While it can still use a lot of work, especially the aura you release from the blade, this is a monumental achievement. Now you need to work on reinforcing the aura coating on your blade. If you can also retain the destructive properties of anima when releasing it, it'll become all the more powerful. Yes, we must work on this even more. Mom? Ha! Huh. Cecilia raised her head looking at Dirk's rice smile. We have two days left. Oh. Chapter 116, Obsidious. After two weeks of training, Dirk had officially become a rook-class warrior. This was unheard of for rank fours, but he had done it. Dirk didn't think it was that difficult though. His anima resonance destruction technique, specifically the blood destruction, gave him the ability to fluidly circulate anima throughout his body. Just finishing blood destruction made him a knight class capable of creating aura. The rest came down to his control, and if Dirk was good at anything, it was bending things with his powerful will. Except instead of forcing dark mana to cooperate, it was using his bodily energy to force his aura to settle down. Miraculously, utilizing aura didn't take mental energy. It took anima and bodily energy. When Dirk wrapped the knife in his aura, it also felt like an extension of his sense of touch. It was an odd feeling, but since Dirk had been relying on mana vision for so long now, it didn't surprise him much. Unfortunately, he couldn't progress much further. There were only two more days until Pandora's deadline. Plus, Dirk was dead tired. His mind was unbelievably strong, and he could ignore virtually all manner of pain. But that didn't mean his body could follow his mind. He had been training for over 20 hours a day, only getting a few hours of rest before continuing. It was hellish training by any normal standard, something only Dirk could withstand. And over time, fatigue had built. Long story short, he needed rest. So after Dirk took his step to become a rook class, he engorged himself with food before falling asleep. As he refused to drink potions of any kind, he relied on food for all his energy. He ate a few pounds of meat every day. This meat also came from powerful monsters at the tier 5 level, courtesy of Pandora and her fat wallet. Like that, 
He slept for an entire day, only waking up on the last day of the deadline. Wakey wakey, sleeping beauty. Ha! Huh. Dirk's head raised at the gentle voice. At first he thought it was his mother, but after his brain took a second to boot up, he realized it definitely wasn't his mother. Dirk's hand shot out, pointing to his bedside. The pistol appeared at the same time, and the barrel was placed against a soft object. Now you're poking my boobs with that thing? How am I supposed to retain my purity if you keep violating me like this? Please be quiet. Dirk's head fell back to his pillow, feeling another wave of exhaustion come over him. His pistol transformed into spite, the cat laying on his stomach and lazily eyeing Pandora. Cat. Bonjour. Spite responded dully as Pandora took a seat on the bed. She looked as elegant and stunning as always, but Dirk couldn't care less. He was more concerned about the dark madness hiding under that pretty shell. We leave tomorrow. Ah. Uh, I hear you've made fantastic progress in the last two weeks. Tier 4 spells and a rook class. You're finally catching up to your true potential. Ah. Uh, Pandora's mouth twitched before she pointed her finger. Dirk suddenly felt a wave of frost chill his neck, forcing him to jolt upward. Ack! Dirk smacked her hand away, causing her to snicker. I didn't know you could be so lazy. What do you want? Well, I wanted to be nice and equip you with a bunch of weapons, but you're not being very cooperative. She smiled as Dirk sat up. He took a deep breath and grabbed a black strip of cloth tying it over his cursed eyes. Next time, start with that. You're much more emotional than before, but you still take things way too seriously. Anything concerning you needs to be taken seriously. Haven't warmed up to me yet? She pouted and scooted closer, causing Dirk to jump off the other side of the bed. I may have told you my skill set, but that doesn't mean I trust you. If you're following me into a world of descending hell, then it would be better if that changed. Pandora's tone became a level more serious, but Dirk only responded with a snort. It'll change when you prove that giving you my trust won't get me killed. Finally, Pandora frowned deeply. She stood forcefully, seemingly about to erupt with anger. You still think I'm that psycho from Earth? I don't know otherwise. Pandora was silent for a moment. And with a sudden change in temperament, her face turned neutral while she walked to the door. When you decide to receive your weapons, come find me in the kingdom's treasury. Where is that? Use your fucking soul connection and figure it out yourself. Slam. She exited with a bang. Dirk frowned as he heard her shoes click down the hallway. Pandora left the building with a tremble. I'm trying, damn it. After Dirk left his room to search for the treasury, he ran into his mother. She had been searching for him and her first words were thus. It's about time for me to leave. Now? Yes. Your father says he needs me in Horizon. Cecilia was solemn, Dirk sensing her urgency. He called me back earlier, and I've delayed for these past two weeks. Pandora was right. The world is in chaos right now. Several Horizon cities have been overrun, and your father is fighting a war against monsters. Viola and Rita also appeared at some point. Ethan is trying to step up like his father. Thankfully the nobles are banding together, but there's nobody to keep them in check besides the emperor who doesn't tend to involve himself with those affairs. There are also powerful monsters that are acting like generals and leading sieges. I understand, Mom. Dirk stopped her words with a smile. Like him, Cecilia was also hesitant about leaving. Deep down, she was still painfully guilty for what Dirk went through. She didn't want to leave him alone out of fear. His otherworldly skill and talent only mitigated these fears a little. She wanted to be there in case he ever needed anything. But seeing his smile, she pushed down her worries. She gave him a big hug. Promise you'll come visit if you pass by the capital. I will. Good. Then I have nothing to worry about. Cecilia separated and quickly said goodbye. Dirk waved as she disappeared from his mana sight, vanishing into the folds of space. He let out a sigh, turning on his heel. 
he walked in a certain direction, following tug of his soul connections. The first connection was vague and connected to Pandora. The second was connected to Spite. He had the cat follow Pandora to reliably find out where the treasury was. The treasury was an underground floor under the spire. It actually extended down into the weightless bridge between the upper and lower cities. Dirk went down a floor, quickly finding his way with the information from Spite. He eventually found a giant set of doors, two guards standing by on either side. Spite had been sitting in front of the doors, staring at the two guards. They didn't move though, just standing there with their emotionless faces. Dirk reached out his arm upon approach, Spite jumping up it and settling on his shoulder. The two guards finally reacted and looked at him. Dirk Strider, the princess awaits. Hmm. Dirk just nodded as the guards opened the doors. He walked in, entering a massive room filled with display cases and shelves. Pandora sat in the center of the treasury, specifically on top of a display case housing a huge gemstone. She didn't look happy, obviously mad about their previous conversation. Of course, Dirk didn't feel bad. He knew just how dangerous, volatile, and borderline evil this woman was. While she had definitely changed after being reborn, the souls were still the same. Until he could truly confirm that he could trust her, he wouldn't ever place his life in her hands. Not even a magical war between dragons and gods would change this. If anything, it made him all the more cautious. He could deal with her antics, her odd clinginess, and her teasing. He would help her with her objectives and let her help him. They could cooperate while riding this storm. But that didn't mean he trusted her. Dirk had made that clear, and he would act accordingly. About time. Pandora glared at him before jumping off the display case. Follow. She waved, and with measured strides, led Dirk down another level. They entered a second treasury after getting past a single old man that gave Dirk goosebumps. The entrance to this second treasury room was actually a ladder. After climbing down, they suddenly became weightless, and they entered. The second floor was a room designed while ignoring gravity. Display cases were scattered across all levels of space, the power of darkness keeping them anchored in the air. Pandora moved herself to one display case. Inside of it was a blob that looked like some kind of murky slime. It bounced around the display case while ripples caused spikes to jet out of its body. This is a high-level artifact of our Dark Kingdom, produced by a forge master and alchemist working jointly. It was their life's work, and there's only one in existence because they literally gave their lives to produce this. Their creation unfortunately didn't care too much for its parents and attacked them. They died after killing the hostile ego and planting another one with their souls as the price. Since then, it's been sitting in this treasury, waiting for its new master. Now, it's yours. Only, you'll need to tame the ego within. Do that, and you'll have a powerful tool at your disposal. If you can't, then we'll find something else. Dirk was silent, gazing at the bouncing blob within the glass case. He wanted to know what this item was, but he didn't believe it mattered. Whatever it was, it was powerful, so it would be useful no matter what. With that, Dirk drifted over. Pandora flicked her finger, and they were suddenly encased in an ice dome. The dome was incredibly solid, filled to the brim with earth and water mana that reinforced it dozens of times over. Dirk wouldn't be able to break the dome in a short amount of time. Then, she tapped the glass. The wall of the case melted away, releasing the blob. The blob shot out to escape, but Dirk was a step ahead. His hand shot out, and it looked like the blob threw itself into his grasp. Dirk grabbed the slime. It felt like melted rubber, yet had a strange metallic quality to it like fine grains of iron. A second after grabbing the slime though, Dirk felt an odd connection be initiated with it. Their minds, their egos, were suddenly connected. The slime hadn't known anything other than loneliness. It was first born from the souls of two artisans, one of the greatest forge masters and one of the greatest alchemists. The two had actually been secretly in love and it was the only reason they had worked together on such a profound project. They gave their all for their creation. For both of them, the project was like making a baby. 
they came to love it like a child. Such was the natural inclination for masters and their crafts. And through their passion, they came to love each other even more. And their efforts bore fruit. A single mass of magic, material, and soul. The black blob didn't look like much, taken as nothing more than a botched concoction. But the artisans knew better. Unfortunately, through a freak turn of events, the creation turned on its creators. The blob exercised its greatest abilities, attacking the two masters in order to save its life from a non existent threat. The masters fought back to their great distress. They subdued the rogue ego within their creation, paying a great price to do so. They were left on death's doorstep, and their child had turned to nothing more than expensive goop. It was a horrible failure, and now, the couple couldn't fix their mistake. Unless, of course, they paid the ultimate price. With their strong wills, the two artisans mustered their energy, expelling their remaining power. They restructured the blob on the spot. Its power was reduced so that it could never kill its next master, and if they had left it in that state, it would remain a low-class artifact for the rest of its time. But they couldn't bear such a sorrowful end. So they did what only few through history had ever done before. They used the power of their souls to empower the artifact. They gave it not an artificial ego, but a true intelligence birthed from a soul. A baby born from their union. And so, they turned to dust, the blob left as a naive child with no master. It was picked up by the vampire queen subsequently and dumped into the treasury out of naivety. Since then, it had lived an aimless life confined to a glass box. The vampire queen had initially planned to give it to a talented subordinate. But years went by and she both forgot and lost interest. Now, Pandora had come and dictated its use. For the first time in years, the blob was free. It escaped its cage, eager to do literally anything else other than bounce around the box. But then, it was blocked by a hand. The blob was more curious than anything. It carried no hostility and didn't know the concept of danger. It had never even felt pain. All it knew was that the hand was something new, so it wanted to play around. But upon making contact with the hand, something inside of it was triggered. The blob felt a connection be created between it and Dirk. And it saw Dirk's mind. Flashes of information containing scattered experiences from Dirk's two lives. The child who was beaten into a soldier. The cold killer who exterminated thousands from the face of the earth. The despair of betrayal and loss. The rebirth of a new child. The love of a mother. The descent into hell. Key instances from Dirk's lives played out in the blob's mind. In this way, it learned a lot. In fact, it learned far more than it wanted to. The blob's soul trembled. It understood Dirk's plight, but more than anything, it was afraid. It became deathly terrified of the monster known as Dirk. It had never seen such a cold and ruthless mind, one capable of killing anyone without batting an eye. It was so detached, so indifferent, so apathetic. Even Pandora acknowledged the ruthless person Dirk was. As a super soldier, he could truly kill anyone on a whim. If he was ordered to, he would do it, no matter who. While things had changed in his new life and Dirk had now made peace with his past self, he still retained that same ruthlessness. Perhaps in this way, he wasn't too different from Pandora who could so easily discard lives because she felt like it. The blob wanted nothing to do with that sort of person. It was a child that sought a companion. Even now, it cowered from Dirk's fierce gaze. Only, it didn't dare try to escape out of fear that it would be exterminated. Dirk wiped away the scary face, gazing oddly at the blob. He had also seen some of its memories, though they were few. He immediately knew that this blob was like a child, a curious kitten. It had been locked away in this box for so long. In fact, its only significant memories were from when it would see people drift into this treasury. Dirk had seen how it would bounce around in joy and curiosity. But it would always be ignored, making it sad. Now, it finally got a chance to interact with something new. But then it was met with Dirk's cruel memories. It trembled in his hand, barely keeping itself from melting away. He had thought that this thing had some strong ego that would try to attack him for attempting to wield it. 
but it was just a child. Not even Dirk was so heartless as to attack and subdue a child. At least, not anymore. His head snapped at Pandora. What the hell? What? This thing is a child. You had me thinking it was some kind of monster. How was I supposed to know that? I just gave you the facts of its origin. Now hurry up and tame it. It's supposed to be some kind of symbiotic artifact. Pandora just waved lazily. She really didn't care as she was still mad at Dirk. He snorted at her before turning his attention back to the blob trembling in his hands. Ah, sorry, little guy. He spoke softly, patting the slime with his fingers. The thing fit in his palm, making it look pitiful. He really did feel bad too. I'm not that heartless anymore. He mumbled, tapping into the connection formed between them. He tried to reassure it, letting it know that while he could still be a killing machine, he could be nice too. The little blob could feel his intent, and gradually, its trembling stopped. The bad memories it saw of Dirk's past faded, and it warily wiggled around in his hand. It wasn't sure whether to trust him or not. Then, he spoke. I'm not sure what you can do, but do your best, and I'll give you mine. I might be able to kill anybody, but if there's one thing I value, it's the gun that helps me keep my life. I won't get rid of you. Dirk reassured the blob in his own special way. And it seemed to work. When the blob saw what he meant, its hesitation was wiped away. Like the child it was, its attitude reversed on the flip of a dime, becoming excited. As if that was the trigger, Dirk felt the connection between them strengthen. A power within the blob activated, and a massive magic circle appeared over the two. Six magic circles stacked on top of each other, hundreds of runes flying between them and causing the surrounding mana to go crazy. Warning! The Heart of Promises has been satisfied. Familiar connection established. Would you like to accept, Obsidious, as your familiar? Chapter 117 Embark Dirk was surprised seeing the notifications. Because this was his goal though, he readily accepted. When he did, the magic circles all activated, the power piercing toward Dirk's soul. He felt a light searing pain before a brand appeared on the back of his right hand holding the blob. At the same time, the faint connection to the blob strengthened several times over, becoming a full bridge between their souls. Dirk could understand the thoughts and feelings of the blob in that moment, and it could likewise feel his. Their minds were connected. Obsidious. Dirk mumbled the blob's name. It was fitting, given the blob's void black color and metallic feel. It bounced up and down in his hand. Familiar, Obsidious, accepted. Profile. Name, Dirk Strider. Species, Human. Tier, 4. Rank, 4. Attributes, Fire 100%, Lightning 100%, Earth 100%, Metal 100%, Dark 100%. Traits, Cybernetic Enhancement, Adaptable Genes, Pure Soul. Skills, AI Interface, Grade 7. Mana Resonance, Grade 5, Mana Lungs, Grade 5, Restoration, Grade 5. Stigma, Black Cat of Calamity. Familiar, Obsidious. Familiar Skills, Symbiotic Armor, Living Flame, Living Gloves, Pocket Dimension, Molding. Hmm. Dirk was surprised as the magic circles served their purpose and faded away. He read the skills of Obsidious curiously. He can become an armor. He has a pocket dimension, like a pocket ring. I can store items then. I'm not sure what the others are, though the gloves are somewhat self-explanatory. Wonder why they're special. Dirk stood there in silence, thinking to himself as Obsidious wrapped around his fingers and massaged them. What's a living flame? He suddenly asked. He actually remembered his forging master, Sir Tobastin, telling him something about it. He supposedly had one. Pandora explained. Living flames are powerful and basically infinite sources of magical fire that gain mild sentience and life. A skilled fire mage can tame them, making them a kind of familiar to use alongside fire magic, forging, or alchemy. 
they have a variety of uses in anything related to fire, and since they're spawned from source mana, they don't run out. Does that thing have one? Yeah. Dirk nodded. Then, after urging Obsidius with his mind, the blob settled on his hand. Whoosh! A flame suddenly ignited, almost as if Obsidius was burning itself. The fire was a deep red, though not amazingly obscenely. It was definitely weaker than the living flame Sir Tobastan had in his forge. However, even if Dirk used his full power to create a hot flame, it wouldn't be as hot as this one. Plus, living flames were more special than just hot fire. Wow. Impressive. You know, you can actually increase the power of living flames by absorbing others. Weak living flames are actually the most valuable since you can tame them easily and grow them. If we had a weaker one in the treasury, I'd give it to him. The only one we have though is equal to a tier 7 in power. The blob would get eaten instead. Right. Dirk nodded in understanding. Obsidius stopped releasing its fire at the same time, going back to massaging his hand as if it were teething. It was then that Dirk narrowed his eyes, looking at the fingers on his right hand. There had been a ring there, but it was gone. What did you do? He asked, and Obsidius shook in response. His pocket ring was spit out, Dirk grabbing it with his other hand. Upon inspection though, he found it was empty. My stuff? Obsidius blew a bubble, making a pop sound. Dirk's attention was then brought into the pocket space. There, he found all his stuff, plus a bunch of empty space. Dirk was surprised. His pocket ring only had a space a few meters in diameter. But Obsidius actually had a large 20 meter space. That's a lot. Very useful. Dirk thought pleasantly. He could store large bodies in there if he needed to. He could also pack a bunch of items with space left over. It looked like he wouldn't need a backpack for this trip, not that Pandora wasn't filthy rich enough to buy all the pocket rings she wanted. Finally, Dirk wondered about the armor skill of Obsidius. And with his urging, Obsidius complied. The blob suddenly expanded. At first it could fit on his palm, covering his hand when spread thin. But now, it rapidly attained mass from seemingly nowhere. The black metallic slime spread up Dirk's arm before covering his entire body. After completely engulfing him, the slime hardened, taking on a distinct form. It was a slim black armor that covered every inch of his body. One could see the outlines of muscles along the arms and legs, each fiber and joint clearly defined as if the armor had muscles of its own. The chest and abdominal muscles were prominent not unlike Dirk's while the head was totally featureless. It wasn't a normal plate armor, but another skin. If this armor didn't cover Dirk, he would take it for Obsidius' body. The armor only took a few seconds to take its form as Obsidius conformed to the shape of Dirk's body, learning his figure. Even when it hardened though, Dirk felt his movement remain uninhibited. In fact, he felt better than ever. The armor seemed to tap into the power of his body, enhancing his strength with its own. Dirk could feel the toughness and flexibility of it. He could even feel the ability to stream his mana and anima into it. Clearly it wouldn't inhibit his aura or magic in any way. If anything, it would enhance those too. While there was a bit of adapting to do, the connection between Obsidius and Dirk allowed them to fully cooperate. Obsidius had no trouble tapping into Dirk's power, exchanging his own. The transition was seamless. Good armor. Dirk mumbled in happiness. This was definitely a fantastic piece of equipment. It covered everything with no gaps and allowed him to retain his full combat ability, even enhancing it. And Dirk knew that he would only learn to work with Obsidius better in the future. They would complement each other. After a short minute of getting used to each other, Obsidius shrunk back down to his normal blob form. Dirk smiled at him. Truly, Obsidius had abilities that did justice to the life's contribution of a great forge master and alchemist. They didn't disappoint. Pandora watched from the side. Truthfully, neither she nor the vampire queen knew about the true abilities of this blob. It was only known that it could become an armor, but because it didn't contain that much power, it never got used. 
after a bit of thought, she had chosen it to become Dirk's armor. After all, it couldn't be that bad considering the price to make it. And it turned out to be much better than they thought. A full body armor, a living flame, and a pocket dimension. While there were two more abilities Dirk didn't test out yet, just those three were enough to make it a valuable artifact. Done yet? Pandora suddenly asked as Obsidius jumped around Dirk's body. He faced her before nodding. Then let's head back up. The air swirled around them as she said that, pushing the two back the way they came. After walking back into the first treasury room, Pandora brought Dirk over to another side room. The room was filled with various pieces of equipment. Dirk saw a lot of guns and their ammo, along with some enchanted weapons strewn about some tables. There were also basic supplies and accessories, more than Dirk knew what to do with. You have armor and a magical pistol. Now you get to take a few enchanted melee weapons to use with your aura. I've packed all types of clothes for different situations and survival supplies in case anything goes south on our trip. There are also some accessories with magical functions, one of which is used for long-distance communication. Pick your gear and pack the essentials on that table. I'm going to grab our ride. We leave the city in four hours. Pandora briefed him before leaving. Dirk watched her exit the treasury before focusing on the plethora of weapons in front of him. Though, his thoughts were a bit complicated. He knew Pandora was pissed. He could feel it through their soul bond. He had felt her rage in the morning too. But despite her rage, she still handed him an exceedingly valuable artifact and was loading him with weapons and gear. They weren't entering this storm unequipped. It was a sincere gesture on her part. She didn't just drag him off to go fight hordes of monsters barehanded. She was concerned for his safety and power. But that begged a few questions. Was she doing this because she valued his life or because she valued his abilities? He had few secrets that she didn't know. She knew his full combat power and exactly what he was capable of. So was this protection an investment or helping a friend? Dirk certainly didn't believe they were friends. No matter how comfy Pandora got with him, this was definitely business. In exchange for his talent and killing, she provided the resources and the battlefield to grow in. They were about to enter this battlefield in the hopes of acquiring an extremely powerful artifact. They were fighting against the gods at the behest of the dragons, the agents that would be moved in order to steer this war toward the desired outcome. Pandora used this as an opportunity to grow her own power alongside her influence using technology. She sought nothing less than world domination, at least in Dirk's mind. And Dirk was one of the most powerful weapons she could wield, especially with his potential guaranteed by his pure soul. It was a give and take for both of them. Dirk was already in her debt. But he couldn't help but feel bad. Sure he didn't trust her, and until she proved otherwise, he wouldn't ever place his life in her hands. In fact, Dirk would only ever willingly place his life in the hands of his mother, she being the most trustworthy person in his life. But he was different from how he used to be. He was treating her coldly, and she was still helping him. He felt hypocritical, like a parasitic leech just taking her valuables and giving nothing in return. While he knew he would be fighting very soon, he still had these thoughts. He was torn between the person he knew and the person with him now. He knew Pandora contained deep madness within her, the mind of an evil genius. He remembered vividly the atrocities her people and criminals committed, the acts of terrorism that sought to bring down global establishments. Tens of thousands died at the hands of her people, many of them being soldiers and military. She was psychotic. Deranged. If not for her not having absolute total control over the council on earth, then she really would be a truly evil person. The only reason she wasn't the worst human being in Dirk's mind was because the others of her council were independent to some extent, carrying out many of those aforementioned atrocities. When Dirk thought about it, he knew that she really only attacked the establishments, carrying out raids on secret projects and hindering the development of world governments. It was how she came to clash with him. And if Dirk was sure of anything now, it was that he hated the people who abandoned him. Those governments that betrayed him were the worst in his mind. 
if he thought about it more, the things she did weren't as bad as he used to think they were. He no longer minded the thought of those who betrayed him losing all their power. And now, Pandora was a new woman. The princess of the Dark Kingdom, the daughter of the Vampire Queen, a woman with modern science and technology in her head, and a mind that could influence entire empires. She was smart, but now that she wasn't psychotic and mentally damaged, she was more normal. She actually had emotions, as did Dirk. She could get angry, she could smile in happiness. He had even seen her get a bit sad when Spite didn't let her pet her. She was more human than ever, an ironic statement considering she was a vampire now. Dirk could see all this. He saw her past and saw her now, and he wondered which one he should believe. To what extent did her madness rule her mind? How willing was she to betray him if it benefited her to do so? They had a deep connection and history, but how much did she value it? Dirk wanted to know what was behind that pretty face, behind those blood-red eyes that saw through everything. She wants to rule the world, and wants me to help her. That'll take a long time. Guess I'll have to observe for a while. Dirk thought before looking at the weapons in front of him. Then, he made his selections, preparing himself for what was to come. There was a small vehicle sitting outside the spire. The vehicle was shaped like a modern car with wheels and everything. It looked like an SUV, though because it was obviously enchanted, it lacked many of the defining features of an actual car. It was like someone stripped a vehicle of all its internals. Pandora was leaning against this car as Dirk walked over to her. He was surprised by the ride. You built this? Had it built by a forge master and enchanted. I didn't opt for flying since ground travel is safer for weaker mages. This thing uses earth magic to drive, and for the most part, everything is just looks. The inside is gutted besides some comfortable surface material. It'll be both our ride and tent. Even on rough terrain, it's capable of up to 80 miles an hour. Oh. Very nice. Dirk nodded pleasantly. He was definitely happy to be riding in a car. After all, it would be a long trip. All right, hop in. She spoke as she opened the door and got into the driver's seat. Dirk climbed into the passenger side and settled in while Pandora hit the gas pedal. The seats were lined with cushioning materials, making them more than comfortable enough for a long ride. The car jolted forward, proceeding to drive down the paved roads of her dark kingdom. It didn't take long for them to reach the gate, and she didn't even stop as she was automatically let through. Like that, they left the capital city, riding off into the distance. The lands around the capital were mostly plains, so they drove through open roads for a long while. We're taking a route that follows the eastern borders all the way up to the Dwarven Haven. We're cutting straight through Horizon territory on the way, but we'll be nowhere near the capital. Unfortunately, there's one problem we may run into. Pandora spoke dully as she lazily drove the car. Dirk leaned into his seat and hummed. What's that? I have a railroad that's being laid as we speak, leading up to the haven. It cuts straight through the land for the fastest travel time, so it avoids any roads. But we need to follow the roads, and along the way, we'll be passing within 70 miles of a known major dungeon. Thankfully the railroad is out of the way, so it isn't at risk of getting attacked. But we're obviously not following the railroads. We're cutting through a monster horde. Correct. And why didn't we bring anybody with us? I told you, this is our own battle. Our mission is a total secret. There's no way I would bring anybody with us. Nobody even knows where we're going, including my bodyguard who I left behind in the kingdom. From now on, we're on our own. Pandora smiled a bit, seemingly liking the thought of moving independently. She had been a princess all her life, so her every action and word were always under close scrutiny and judgment. For possibly the first time in her life, she was breaking away from her life of constrained royalty, embarking on a grand adventure with total freedom. Dirk just sighed, petting Spite who curled in his lap. The world was about to take a step forward. Chapter 118, Gunner Slash Checkpoint The route to the Dwarven Haven was long, easily over 3,000 miles. The trip wouldn't be short. 
At least, that was if a normal wagon were traveling this route. With Pandora's specially constructed car, they could average around 60 miles an hour. While the bumpy roads made the drive rougher and slower than on paved road, they were still moving at a speed far greater than wagons. Pandora also told him that the car was designed to drive at those speeds for around 8 hours straight. After that, it would need to recharge for double the time. That meant they could drive for 8 hours a day. At 60 miles an hour, they could travel almost 500 miles a day. That would place them near their destination in a week. That was if nothing else happened, though. And if the world lacked anything right now, it was peace and quiet. Five hours in, they spotted their first monster. Dirk rested in the passenger seat. If his eyes weren't cursed, he would have had them closed. The new equivalent of shutting his eyes was unfocusing on the man around him, relaxing his senses. We're getting close. To where? The major dungeon. Suddenly, Dirk's senses sharpened. Their route would actually take them to one of the vanguard cities of Horizon right on the border. They were using those roads, and they would continue after going around the city. But between them and the city, off to the northwest, was a major dungeon. Dirk had only heard Pandora talk about how the lesser dungeons all disappeared, being eaten by the major dungeons. After that phenomenon, the major dungeons suddenly released all their monsters, including the monsters of the lesser dungeons they ate. This made the surroundings of every major dungeon a monster-infested war zone. Any unlucky cities that happened to be built near these major dungeons were overrun. But Dirk had yet to actually see it. It wasn't like he didn't believe her. But he wanted to confirm just how huge these monster hordes were. If the monsters mostly came from the lesser dungeons, then how strong could the hordes be? Now, he finally got to see it. Their route was surrounded by nothing but flat grasslands. It was usually very picturesque, filled with patches of tall trees and groves of flowers and plants. But now, Dirk saw nothing but desolate grounds ravaged by the tens of thousands of monsters that tread over them. In the distance, Dirk could make out hordes of monsters of all kinds marching across the plains. They were actually moving in the same direction they were. But the car obviously attracted attention as a fast-moving vehicle kicking up dirt. We're charging through. Get ready to defend. Pandora became serious. Dirk nodded before standing and climbing into the back. He then punched open a hatch on the roof of the car, sticking his torso through. A sniper rifle appeared in his hands at the same time. That was when Pandora floored it. She usually stayed at 60 miles an hour because it was most efficient. The faster she went, the more mana would be dissipated in the process of driving. But now, she had no reservations as she pushed it to its limits. The car stormed down the roads, rattling the chassis. But Dirk was able to keep himself steady despite standing and he aimed his rifle while resting it on the roof of the car. At that moment, the thousands of monsters to the side of the road noticed them, and they immediately charged over. The ground quaked under the charge of these large monsters. Many of them were beasts of some kind. Dirk saw fire lizards, bears with armor of rock, and tigers with claws of wind. Birds swooped down at high speeds, spreading their talons at the new prey. It was overwhelming. An entire monster army couldn't be stopped by Dirk alone. Even if he entrenched himself and held his ground, he would be overrun. There were too many, even if they were weak. But he didn't need to kill them all. He just needed to protect the car while Pandora charged through. Bang! A large tiger that had stepped in front of the stampede suddenly saw a hole pierce through its eye socket. It was over 400 meters away. The body collapsed instantly tripping and hindering several others behind it. Dirk took aim as that happened. Bang! Another bullet, and a large bear that was moving too fast for its own good fell to the ground. A couple dozen monsters tripped and piled around the new obstacle while a few with quick reactions jumped over. Dirk sent bullets through the skulls of monsters that threatened to reach them quickly. Ones that looked strong were also tested and under the high-power anti-material rifle, all of them died. Pandora knew exactly what bullets were capable of and how strong monsters and people could be. 
she didn't skimp on the rifle's strength, otherwise she may as well have not made them. Bang! Another shockwave shook the planes. A bird fell from the sky at the same time, crashing into the oncoming horde. With that, Dirk finally stopped. The sniper disappeared from his hands, entering obsidious pocket space. Then, another weapon appeared. Dirk mounted the machine gun atop the roof, aiming to the left side. Pandora continued to charge down the road, and monsters got ever closer to intercepting them. The pressure mounted, and Pandora found herself becoming serious. She was taking in every detail of the road in order to make sure they weren't slowed down. Her heart raced a bit in excitement despite the palpable tension. That was because of Dirk. She could imagine his blank face right now, one that cared for nothing more than ruthless efficiency. And she felt a chill when she heard him skillfully load a belt of 50 caliber rounds into the gun. She couldn't help but look to the side, gazing pitilessly at those oncoming monsters. There was only one thing she was disappointed by. Too bad we can't harvest their crystals. Bang 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 bang. Plumes of flame exited the barrel alongside seeds of death. Pandora smiled giddily as a line of monsters suddenly collapsed sixty meters away. Dirk taped down the trigger with his finger, moving the barrel to point at the heads of those in his sights. Even as the car raced down the road, he was purely focused on clearing the way, keeping monsters from stopping their momentum. Shells bounced around Dirk's feet after they were ejected, producing the harmonious sounds of clinking brass. His machine gun simultaneously orchestrated the screams and roars of monsters. After several seconds, a belt was finally consumed. Dirk rapidly grabbed another one from Obsidious pocket space and loaded it as if he had done so thousands of times before. Within two seconds, he racked the charging handle and pulled the trigger again, letting another volley flow from the metal tube. The car continued to barrel down the road, and monsters kept collapsing in on them. Waves in the front threatened to halt their drive, but Dirk skillfully cut them down with precision. Nothing even stepped on the road ahead. Pandora racing by piles of corpses. A trail of dust was kicked up for miles as they raced against this monster tide. It lasted for over an hour. Even as one of Dirk's barrels threatened to melt, he merely changed it out before continuing. When it irreversibly jammed, he merely pulled out another machine gun, continuing his barrage. It was an hour and a half later when they finally passed the worst of it. At some point when the sun began to set, Dirk ceased his fire, preventing the attraction of any strays. They had passed the horde. When things were clear, Dirk sunk back into the car, climbing into the passenger seat. Pandora glanced at him. Count? 28,000 rounds. Ouch! She cringed a bit. She had obviously prepared tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition for this trip. But in under two hours, Dirk had spent almost 30,000. The ring on his finger dedicated to ammo storage was now much less full. That's about 20% of our machine gun ammo. We need to be more sparing. If the situation allows for it, then I'll try. Or we can use magic. My magic would have negligible effects. And you just enjoyed the show. Eh. She shrugged, causing Dirk to roll his eyes. While he didn't know just how powerful her magic was, he knew she was definitely much more powerful than him. After all, she was exclusively a mage with four attributes. There was no way that she was any less powerful than a high tier 5. If she had helped in that battle, they could have used much less ammunition. Dirk didn't care either way. Tools were meant to be used. He wouldn't spare ammo and risk getting stopped by the hordes. So much as slowing down would have put them in a perilous situation. Well, we're at least ahead of schedule now. Pandora adjusted in her seat. The car has an hour of driving left in it. When the tank is dry, we'll stop for the day and continue when it recharges. We should be at our first checkpoint by tomorrow afternoon. She calculated out with a map in her head. She already had this trip planned out fully. While this little event threw off their schedule a bit, it wasn't anything they couldn't adapt to. Dirk didn't nod or hum, just sitting back relaxedly. Spite appeared on his lap while Obsidious bounced around the cat. 
the two had begun playing with each other, Obsidious being batted by Spite's paws. After another hour, the car began to slow down. Pandora drove off the road, parking in the midst of some trees. When the car jolted to a halt, the two sat there in silence. Well, now we wait. It'll recharge on its own. Pandora climbed out of her driver's seat. The entire trunk of the car was empty besides a large mattress with pillows and blankets. She had intended for this car to be their tent as well, so the two never had to brave the elements or get their hands dirty in the wilderness. Dirk suddenly asked. How armored is this car? It can easily withstand the attacks of a tier 5, perhaps getting damaged by a tier 6. Even if a horde of monsters piled on us, they would have a very difficult time tearing into this thing. And with all the supplies I stocked up on, we could technically live in here for months. Dirk nodded a bit. Pandora actually had a small box filled exclusively with pocket rings of different sizes. They were all filled with varying kinds of ammunition, tons of food, mana crystals, anima bones, and more. They were the furthest thing from unequipped, carrying with them a large fortune. Since it was now later in the day, the two checked out. Pandora cast a few air spells that acted as alarms. Dirk also did his destruction cycle, extracting the dense anima from the bone of a strong monster skull. Dirk had learned the advanced anima resonance technique that was required to go beyond blood destruction. Though, he guessed that he hadn't mastered it yet, which is why he didn't get the related skill as Pandora had mentioned a while back. Still, it vastly sped up his destruction cycles. With denser anima and a better technique, his muscles were both destroyed more thoroughly yet ingrained with far more anima. On top of that, he healed faster, a courtesy of the increased anima content and his body boosting his restoration skill. Instead of the initial 26 weeks, Spite had calculated a short 7 more weeks until he finished muscle destruction. Of course, that was if he did a destruction cycle every day. There would likely be periods where he didn't, prolonging the process. Pandora also urged Dirk to do some magic study. While the two only had the mutual attribute of Earth, they could still exchange some general ideas. Comprehending runes was one such way for them to cooperate. Pandora had even brought a few magic texts, one of them on the Dark Element. Vampires were the world's leaders in terms of Dark Element proficiencies, so they had no shortage of profound texts available. Pandora gave one to Dirk, intending to further his understandings. Like that, the depths of night fell. Pandora was quick to get comfortable in the trunk of the car, sprawling across the mattress. Care to join me? Seeing Dirk in the front passenger seat, she patted the space next to her, beckoning him with those alluring ruby eyes. Dirk frowned a bit as he turned his head back. Wasn't she still mad at him? It wasn't like her emotions couldn't flip on a whim though, so he didn't care too much. Still, he shook his head. I'll sleep here. But those seats aren't as comfortable as this luxurious mattress. I could sleep on rocks, let alone a cushioned seat. Besides, my body stays alert when I'm less comfortable. Something we need out here. He sunk into the chair with those words, coming to rest like a statue. Pandora just shrugged, collapsing into the pillows around her. Get up! Suddenly, Dirk's head shot up. His mana vision concentrated, and in his mind, he could see Spite's vision. About 500 meters away, there was a huge horde of monsters rushing toward them, snarling as if launching an offensive on the car. Without hesitation, Dirk moved and slammed open the hatch on the top of the car. A machine gun appeared in his hands. Pandora! Wake up! Pandora! Dirk shouted and looked down. Pandora was out cold, sleeping like a brick. She wasn't roused by his yell at all. Snorting, he just looked forward. The familiar sound of belt-fed ammo being chambered into the gun was like music to his ears. And he mercilessly pulled the trigger. rat -a -ta, ta ta Dirk opened fire, hot brass falling to his feet. The front line of monsters that were approaching from afar were cut down cleanly. At the same time, Pandora's eyes shot open. Ack! Damn it, Dirk! You're loud! Pandora snarled as the percussive sound made her ears ring and hot casings burned her skin. 
she curled in on herself before taking a guess as to what was going on. She eventually pulled herself up, stumbling into the driver's seat. Asterisk SKRR. Asterisk. The wheels of the car spun as she slammed the gas pedal, creating skid marks in the hard dirt below them. The car jolted forward, climbing onto the paved road before shooting into the distance. Now in the open, the two could more clearly see the hordes around them. The sun hadn't even risen yet, and yet the glow of mana lit up the armies of monsters. The hell? Pandora was observing the monsters as she drove and fully regained consciousness. As she thought, they weren't aiming for them. Instead, she could see monsters in the back line attacking each other, ripping apart other monsters like they were rabid. The ones in front were running from these rabid beasts, but even they were hostile against their fellow escapees. Then, she saw something peculiar. The victorious monsters devoured the mana crystals of their dead prey as if they were unattainable delicacies. The monster would then fluctuate with bursts of mana. She could see the wild fluctuations of mana in her own mana vision. Dirk could see it most clearly though. He could see all the mana crystals within the beasts, and he noticed that the monsters attacking each other were always of a similar element type. A water attribute monster would eat the water mana crystal of another. Doing so seemed to make them more powerful, though a lot of the mana of the attained crystal seemed to be lost in the process. Since the monsters weren't focused on them, Dirk was quick to cease fire and reduce his presence. He would only shoot the ones getting in their way, which thankfully didn't amount to much. Before long, they had left the range of the monster horde, slowing their speed. Pandora brought the car to a cruise as Dirk sunk back down into the seat. What was that all about? Not sure. Pandora was curious. It wasn't like she knew any more than Dirk about this. Monsters used to be confined strictly to dungeons, but now they were out and about the wild. This kind of phenomenon was unheard of. It seemed to be some kind of population control, along with a power boost. Eating mana crystals seems to increase their power. If there are too many in a given area, they go berserk and attack each other, reducing numbers while increasing the power of those near the top of the hierarchy. While it thankfully culls their numbers, it's not so comforting to know they can now evolve unlike when in the dungeons. My mother said something about monsters being led by something similar to a general. Maybe this is the process of creating a general. Pandora sighed. She had heard a lot from those in other cities that she could communicate with. But she had yet to hear of organized attacks by monsters. This little event was worrying. After being silent for a while, Pandora checked the fuel of the car. The car hadn't been able to charge fully, but she was satisfied with where it was at. Our fuel is enough. If we refrain from speeding, we'll reach our first checkpoint by noon. All right. Dirk nodded before letting out a light breath. Pandora glanced at him with narrowed eyes. Are you going back to sleep? No. Bullshit. You dare sleep while I drive? Hey, I don't know how to drive an enchanted vehicle. Besides, I'm the gunner. Dirk smiled a bit. His eyes were closed and covered anyway, so she couldn't tell if he was asleep. Like that, she could only helplessly drive while Dirk got some more shut eye. After several more hours though, they finally made their approach to the first checkpoint. The situation of said checkpoint was anything other than favorable, though. Chapter 119, Siege the first checkpoint was a city on the border within Horizon territory. Before the escalating conflict between the humans and vampires, it was a major trading post. The city was very prosperous, especially with the major dungeon not far from it. But now, the place was on the verge of collapse for that very reason. Pandora drove a distance away from the massive city, circling the walls that surrounded the place. This was due to the horde of monsters launching a siege on the city. Thousands of monsters clawed the gates that had been filled with walls and piles of stone. Many attempted to jump up the walls, and many flying monsters swooped down onto those soldiers that fought in the open. Monsters that cast magic were constantly launching spells after breaking through holes in the walls, setting the city afire and wreaking devastation. Of course, the city was putting up a fight, otherwise it would have long collapsed. 
earth mages were constantly erecting new structures that the soldiers used to defend and attack from. Even citizens were digging trenches in an attempt to help stifle the oncoming monster tides. Every magic and weapon and consumable tool was exhausted in order to cull the thousands that besieged them. How unfortunate. Pandora clicked her tongue. Those cities stationed right by major dungeons definitely got it the worst. Though, she was surprised that this city was able to stand for so long. Still, she never changed course. After driving around, she continued on the paved road, bypassing the city. She never intended to stop at the city to begin with, just using its roads to travel. She planned to continue on to the next checkpoint, wasting no time. Dirk frowned when he realized this though. Stop. What? Don't tell me you intend to help. And if I do? She glanced at him, a bit annoyed. Dirk's face hardened. Stop the car. Fine. SKRR. The car skidded to a halt, but Pandora never took her gaze off Dirk. What do you want to help them for? They can't give you anything. It's a waste of time. I just want to help. There are soldiers there fighting for their lives. We can do something. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. We have more important business at the Dwarven Haven, the value of such business outstripping any good we can do here. Dirk frowned more at her words. While their business at the Haven was important, he still didn't feel right just leaving the city to burn. The two stared at each other for a while. At some point though, Dirk let out a sharp breath, sitting back into his seat and turning his head away from her. He was giving in. Pandora didn't smile though. If anything, she became more annoyed. After a few seconds of deliberating, she grit her teeth. Ugh! She slammed the gas pedal, flipping the wheel and pointing them at the city. The car barreled toward a part of the walls that wasn't being sieged. Dirk glanced at her. What are you dash? Just shut up. I have one condition, and that's not using any of the guns. I don't care how many people will die. You either save lives with your own body and magic, or we're moving on. Got it? Fine. Although her yelling caused his anger to flare, Dirk just nodded. The car soon arrived at one of the city gates. This gate had a smaller amount of monsters attempting to break through it compared to the others. Atop the walls, soldiers were firing arrows and magic spells at the clustered horde below. They obviously spotted the odd vehicle approaching. When the car got closer, a black figure popped out of the top. Dirk emerged, Obsidious wrapping him in his black armor. Even as the car moved, he stepped onto the hood, looking at the fast-approaching monsters. He crouched, and right when Pandora braked, he jumped. His body flew off the hood and sailed through the air. His fist was brought back as he aimed at a large bear-type monster standing eight feet tall. The bear hardly turned before Dirk's fist met its skull. Splat! Upon collision, Dirk's fist was uninhibited as it directly blew up the bear's head. He landed on the floor just as the bear collapsed, sliding across the ground for a second before coming to a stop. The soldiers atop the wall were baffled. The surrounding monsters all turned to Dirk, roaring at him with threatening outbursts of mana. Dirk stood calmly. In his hands appeared two short swords. With his staggering strength, he found short swords better than knives, able to wield them no different from knives. This was actually advice from his mother after training with him, and he grew to agree with her. The grip of each short sword felt good in his hands, even with Obsidious and its layer of armor. It almost felt like he was personally touching the metal hilt. It felt even better than with gloves. After waving the short swords in his hands, he focused on the few monsters that were dashing toward him. He took a step forward. Across the body of his armor, golden lines appeared. Shing! His arm flickered across his body, and a tiger monster fell to the ground alongside its head. Blood splattered onto other monsters nearby. That monster was a rank three, Dirk thought inwardly. Then, with another step, he entered the horde surrounding the gates. Pandora brought the car to a skidding halt outside of the battlefield. She sat there and watched as Dirk dashed between monsters. 
his technique in sword fighting was nothing special. It was simple and direct, lacking any sort of finesse most swordsmen had. Only Dirk's precision was outstanding. But like everything else Dirk did, his actions were straight to the point. When Dirk saw a monster, he instantly planned out the fastest and most efficient way to kill it. While his greatest killer instincts appeared behind a gun, his combat sense still applied even with swords. A slice of the neck, a thrust to the spine, the severance of tendons. Dirk didn't even kill some of the monsters, merely incapacitating them. Before long, a few dozen corpses were bleeding outside the gates, and even more were roaring and growling on the floor. At some point, the soldiers above stopped firing entirely, merely watching as Dirk dispatched every single monster by himself. Asterisk screech. Asterisk. A bird-type monster screamed from above as Dirk killed the last monster in the vicinity. It turned and was about to flee, and one of the mages atop the wall began casting magic to kill it. Before he even finished the spell though, Dirk brought up his hand. Zip! A black streak shot through the air, directly piercing the bird's head. Its body silently fell from the sky before landing with a thud. The mage hastily cancelled his spell, looking down at Dirk. He barely caught a glimpse of the pistol in his hands before it disappeared. At least that thing is silent. Dirk's head turned as the car pulled up beside him. Pandora smiled at him while he shrugged. It's a magic gun, so yeah, it's silent. Hmm. She nodded at Dirk's mumbling. She had seen when he was developing bullet spells for that pistol. And as it was magic, the pistol made no sound like a standard pistol. It was incredibly convenient. Suddenly, the two heard the rattling of chains. Their heads turned and looked at the city gates which had opened just partially. A soldier, one looking like a captain, walked over to them. Dirk mumbled before he could arrive. How do we play this? What do you mean? Our identities. Are we hiding ourselves? Of course not. The more prestige we have, the better. Let our names spread far and wide. Pandora spoke as a matter of factly. Dirk frowned though. That'll attract attention. So? Great tales of our strength can only help us. This is an earth, Dirk. You're not a super soldier anymore. People here respect strength and talent. Especially when it comes to help them. Identify yourselves. Pandora's low voice was interrupted by the shout of the captain. The voice wasn't hostile though. She pat Dirk's shoulder, prompting him to step up. Obsidius retracted as Dirk walked toward the captain. My name is Dirk Strider. I've come to assist in defense of the siege. Strider? The captain was surprised as the two came to a halt in front of each other. As in Mark was Strider? That's correct. I am the second son of Riker Strider. I see. I am Captain Alvarez, head of the Eastern City's troop. If you're really here to help, then we're more than happy to welcome your strength. And who is? Pandora Venatis. Pandora stepped out of the car with a smile, answering the captain. Princess of the Dark Kingdom, and daughter of the Vampire Queen. P-Princess? The captain was taken aback. He had already noticed this girl with her deep purple hair and blood-red eyes. She was so enchanting that his other soldiers couldn't take their eyes off of her. But he didn't think she was actually a vampire princess. What is a princess doing all the way out here? I'm on a trip with the man in front of you. He wanted to help, seeing how your city was being besieged by hordes of monsters. And now, we're here. I see. The captain nodded slowly. He eventually shrugged, deciding that this was above his pay grade. Very well. Follow me into the city. I'll take you to the city, Lord. Thank you. Pandora nodded before climbing back into the car. Dirk got in with her, and they were led into the city. They rolled through the ruined streets. The only buildings left standing were the ones in the center of the city. The outskirts were wastelands and battlefields. They could see the fighting in the distance, mages casting spells that created waves of fire and blades of wind. 
the captain had his soldiers stay behind while he guided Dirk and Pandora to the center palace. They moved quickly, and soon arrived before the massive castle. The two got out of the car and viewed the fortified 300-meter-tall castle. It had its own walls, and upon walking in they could see camps of soldiers who were either running around with supplies or getting their wounds treated. The sight of bodies lined up on beds, getting their wounds sewn up or limbs amputated was grotesque. The stench of blood only made it worse. But after so much fighting, everyone seemed to have grown numb. Even the young soldiers who looked to have been recruited recently were only pale at the sights. Neither Dirk nor Pandora were faced by this though. Dirk's face was blank, as usual. And Pandora had a faint smile, as she always did. It was like they couldn't even see the gore around them. The captain led them into the castle where they found more busy soldiers. He spoke on the way. We've been fighting off waves of monster hordes for three weeks now, ever since the dragon's advent. Dragon's advent? The night that the dragon made its announcement to the world. Everyone heard it, even those in the capital. The entire world changed that day, in more ways than one. I didn't realize that was heard from so far away. Dirk was a bit shocked. He thought the announcement of the Dark Dragon was only heard by those in the local city. Turns out, the entire world heard his roar. Everyone knows about the war cataclysma. Pandora perked up at something else though. How else did the world change, besides the dungeons? Well, this is just our speculation, but we believe there was a change in the elements. After our war against the monsters started, we were forced to recruit able-bodied citizens. During the process though, we found a shocking amount of hidden mages and body refiners. At first we passed it off as coincidence, but after we recruited over a thousand new mages and even more body refiners, we realized that the dragon's advent caused people to awaken, somehow. Either way, the only reason we were able to survive for so long was due to this influx of mages and body refiners. Interesting. Pandora nodded slowly. If anybody found out that they had attributes and affinities good enough to become a mage, they would be frantically trying to get their ability acknowledged. This was the way of the world, where mages and body refiners had vast opportunities open to them compared to ordinary people. Nobody would willingly hide their powers, unless they were ignorant. This sudden discovery of mages and body refiners couldn't have happened coincidentally. After all, everyone had a profile, ordinary or not. If they saw attributes, or the ability to sense anima and mana, they would rush to get themselves appraised. Long story short, this occurrence wasn't natural. Something changed after the dragon's advent, resulting in a surge of mages and body refiners. The captain arrived in front of a large pair of open doors. Inside there was one man giving orders to a few subordinates. He looked haggard, but he was an obvious leader. City Lord. H.M. Captain Alvarez. The city lord turned to the captain, immediately eyeing Dirk and Pandora. His pupils narrowed upon seeing Pandora's face though. The vampire princess. To what do I owe this unexpected visit? My friend and I are here to help, city lord baron. Pandora smiled, and the captain stepped forward. It's true, city lord. The man is Dirk Strider, son of Marquis Strider. He defeated a small horde outside the eastern gate. So you're Riker's son? The city lord's eyebrow raised as he pulled his sight away from Pandora. Dirk nodded to him. Correct, sir. You know my father? I do. You could say we're old war buddies. He also contacted me while looking for you not long ago. I see that things went well. Hmm, thankfully. Dirk let out a light breath. He was truly glad he escaped Azura when he did. Taking another glance at Pandora, the city lord sighed. All right then. You're here to help? I'll take what I can. We've been getting attacked by monsters for the past three weeks. Thankfully we have massive stockpiles of food, and the monsters can also be harvested. In terms of supplies to sustain our dwindling population, we have more than enough. The problem is the rising coordination of the monster hordes. They're creating another general. 
City Lord Baron pointed at the map on the table in front of him. The primary concentration of the hordes are coming from the west. We believe the general is commanding the monsters from there. Though, it's still weak in learning how to control the hordes, so it hasn't grown to become a large enough threat. The clock is ticking, however. It's only a matter of time before it learns to launch strategic attacks against our city. You need to kill the general before then. I'm sure you could do that yourself, City Lord Baron, considering you're a rank 7. So what happened? Pandora stepped forward and eyed the city lord. She knew about him since he was in charge of this city on the border. She made sure to know everyone who could affect any of her plans, and this person who controlled a frontier city and a standing army was one such person to pay attention to. Because of that, she also knew he was a rank 7. The fact that he hadn't taken care of this up-and-coming monster general yet meant something had happened to him that prevented him from doing so. That, or he was just stupid, but those chances were small. The city lord sighed, re-evaluating this princess's deductive abilities. Grabbing the chest plate of the armor he was wearing, he exposed his chest. Through his right chest was a hole over four inches wide, one that they could see through completely. I killed the previous monster general only a week ago. After the fact, I had been exhausted, and I suffered this wound while fighting my way out of the encirclement. I lost my right lung, and this hole remains. My abilities have been hindered since then, and I'm still recovering from internal wounds. I couldn't reliably fight even a rank 5. But you're right. We need to kill this monster general. I've been preparing a team to do so. However, the chances of them successfully killing the general and returning alive are slim. The general is still weak, but there are thousands of monsters out there. They would need to infiltrate those hordes, and doing so without getting noticed is close to impossible. So we need a strong but small team who's willing to risk their lives and assassinate this general. Pandora was quiet, but her smile suddenly widened. She and Dirk glanced at each other, and Dirk couldn't help but smirk a bit. She turned to the city lord. Well, city lord, today really is your lucky day. C-120, abysmal. Pandora managed to convince the city lord to let Dirk take part in this assassination assignment. There was only one problem, though. They didn't actually know the exact identity of the monster general. It was hiding somewhere in the midst of the monster hordes. Only by tracking the greatest concentrations of monsters could they guess where the general was. The city lord had intended to launch a reconnaissance mission first. The monster general had only begun to appear in the last week since killing the one prior. The only reason they knew it was there was due to the monster's oddly coordinated movements. Either way, finding this monster general wouldn't be easy. However, the city lord truly was lucky. Not only was Dirk the perfect one for an assassination, but Pandora had the skill known as Eyes of Truth. She immediately volunteered to track down the monster general using her special eyes to pick out any abnormalities. The city lord, while not entirely trusting this vampire princess, also wouldn't deny their attempts to help. And so they waited until the next day. When night came around, the monster attacks died down, giving everyone time to rest. The city was eerily quiet as darkness fell, a result of only a fraction of the previous population still being alive. The city was on its last legs. It was only until the following afternoon that the attacks picked back up. The soldiers moved as if robots, fending off the hordes from the walls and other fortifications. Pandora stood upon the western wall as all the soldiers beside her rushed to carry out their duties. Arrows and spells were constantly launched from above, killing those below. Many of those who passed the vampire princess were at first enraptured by her beauty. She radiated a palpable air of royalty, her purple hair waving along with the wind and red eyes scanning the monsters in the distance. But when the soldiers found her doing nothing but standing there, watching, they became irked. They wondered why this pompous princess wasn't doing anything but standing in the way. Many of them threatened to bump into her as they ran past, only, when they got close to touching her, their skin began to sting under the bite of extreme frost. It wasn't obvious but she had an extremely cold aura surrounding her. 
and of course, she wasn't standing atop the walls aimlessly. Her eyes were viewing everything in front of her. The vast monster hordes appeared in her vision along with all the different elements that exploded out of their hosts. More than that, she could see faint lines. She caught sight of three different clusters of monsters, from their centers extending a web of mind-controlling threads. These threads made the monsters move like herds, an odd occurrence since monsters were mindless beasts that only sought to kill, eat, and grow stronger. Tell Dirk to come back. She suddenly spoke. Beside her was Spite, and the cat nodded curtly. Below them, a few explosions of fire created a wave of heat that burned a dozen or so monsters. Then, a black figure jumped out of the hordes, aiming for the side of the wall. Bang! Dirk shook the wall as his fingers clawed into its surface. With a little earth magic and a few bounds, he was able to climb it. Unlike Pandora, upon seeing Dirk, many soldiers eyed him with awe and respect. Dirk had been fighting down amongst the hordes, being the only one able to keep his life in such a chaotic environment. He had already killed hundreds in the few hours they fought. What? He asked with a long breath. The featureless head created by Obsidious armor retracted, revealing his face and covered eyes. There are three monster generals. Three? It seems like those three are fighting for control over the monsters. Their hordes occasionally attack each other, but only moderately. They're in a stalemate due to them attacking the city. Anyway, we'll have to kill all three and the monsters will subsequently lose their coordination. Maybe they'll disperse, and the city will be saved. Though, that's being incredibly optimistic. Dirk was silent as he looked off into the distance. His mana vision still wasn't as precise as normal vision, but with all the mana bursting from the monsters, he could see the hordes in the distance clearly. In fact, he found that having Obsidious equipped made his mana vision even clearer. It was like the blob amplified the elements he could sense, making them pop more and give more detail. So what's the plan? He looked at Pandora. Simple. Infiltrate and kill the monster generals. How will I know which monster is the general? Hmm, I'll have to build a spell for it, but I can see the generals rather clearly in my vision. With the spell I have in mind, I'll be able to illuminate the specific monster with light mana. You just need to target the tagged monster. All right. And what about the group formed by the city lord? Them? Pandora glanced at Dirk with a dumb expression. Come on. Since when do you work in a team? When we decide to operate, you can go by yourself. It'll allow you to kill and escape easier without the burden of others. The city lord can thank us after we're done. Fine. Dirk just nodded. He truly was better off working alone. While partners brought more firepower, they also brought more uncertainty. Without any more words, Dirk jumped right back down the wall. Since they had until nightfall, he decided he would fight until a few hours before. Upon landing in the midst of the monster hordes, Dirk's body became taut. His anima activation was light as he slashed a large rodent with his short sword, using that attack to dodge the clawed swipe of another monster. He went on the offensive, carving his own path of carnage. Every step forward not only took a life, but evaded an attack. In this situation, defending wasn't an option, or he would never be able to kill anything. Dirk's body spun around as he went from monster to monster. His swords slashed open their necks, stabbed their chests, and slashed their limbs. Most of the monsters attacking were weak, not stronger than a rank 4. Most were merely rank 2 and Dirk's weapons glided through their bodies with ease. Some were magic monsters, casting spells of all elements that had no regard for friendly fire. Dirk used these to his advantage, killing monsters without so much as touching them. The area around him would only take a minute or so to become devoid of monsters. When that happened, Dirk would just dash to the nearest cluster, wreaking more devastation. His stamina seemed endless as he fought for hours at a time. Dirk smiled as he appreciated the perks of blood destruction. It was only when the sun began to set that Dirk finally calmed down. His breathing was labored, but through his effort he had ended the lives of nearly 4,000 monsters personally. 
the endless hordes seemed to thin a bit under his lone effort. The only reason he could do this was due to him fighting in front of the western gate where the monster generals commanded from. The monsters gathered around them and then attacked the gates. Normally they would break through after several hours, moving the fight within the city where soldiers fell back to their secondary fortifications. This was how it had been for weeks now. But with Dirk there, he single-handedly held them back. Nobody was crazy enough to throw themselves into that mosh pit from hell, so they could only kill from afar with magic. Of course, this decreased everyone's ability to kill, outright making body refiners useless. But the battles were about preservation, not winning. Dirk had saved many lives today alone by throwing himself into that chaos. From above, Pandora smiled the entire time. At some point, Dirk jumped back up the wall, using previously created ledges for a foothold. He landed next to Pandora, taking deep breaths while kneeling, washing away his fatigue. She glanced at him, smirking. How's my super soldier? It was like I was back on Earth, watching you devastate my armies from within. Don't call me that. And I need food. I'm starving. Here. Drink this. It'll recover your stamina. Pandora took out a vial, filled with an unknown potion. She tossed it to him. When he saw it though, he grit his teeth and batted away. Shatter. The vial burst after being backhanded, the liquid within spilling on the floor. Pandora's eyebrow raised, not expecting such a violent response. Sorry. Realizing what he did, Dirk looked away. I don't drink potions. All right. Let's get you fed then. Pandora put out her hand, her voice surprisingly soft. Dirk lifted his head before taking it, pulling himself off the floor. The two made their way back to the castle. Because of obsidious armor, Dirk didn't have a single speck of blood on him after the blob retracted. The black slime bounced on his head excitedly, happy after protecting its master through such a long battle. Through the battle, there were some attacks Dirk either couldn't or didn't bother avoiding. In those moments, he had tested obsidious defense. The armor really was metallic, being both flexible so Dirk could move around yet rigid enough to keep blades from slicing through. Dirk found the armor to be able to block the claws of a rank 3 monster, albeit with some noticeable scratches left behind. If it were a rank 4 monster, Dirk knew that obsidious would be limited in its protection though it would still be infinitely better than nothing. However, these protective abilities only applied if left alone. As Dirk had discovered a while ago, Obsidius could not only enhance his anima, but make use of it. The glowing golden lines that appeared on the black armor were a result of Dirk infusing anima into it. And with his anima, Dirk could reinforce the armor, making it stronger according to the strength of his anima. This meant that, while he'd have to expend more energy, he could enable Obsidious to block the claws of a rank 5 monster. Rank 4 monsters couldn't so much as scratch the armor if he reinforced it. It also helped now that Dirk was a Rook-class warrior, capable of infusing anima into objects without destroying them, instead enhancing them. Today's battles only helped him sharpen his ability to control anima. For nearly all of the battles, he strictly used his anima techniques and short swords to attack, refraining from using magic. Though, one spell he used frequently was Void Walking. He found that he could use it much more than before with his larger dark mana reserves. His proficiency was also steadily rising, able to accurately Void Walk in the midst of dozens of monsters. But as his mother pointed out, he still used it in his odd little way. He'd appear, for a split second, in two places at once while Void Walking. While it did indeed alert the monsters faster, he couldn't find a way to stop using it that way. It just didn't make sense otherwise. You're back. The city lord nodded as Dirk and Pandora entered his headquarters. He noticed Dirk's haggard appearance, and smiled. I've heard about your performance at the West Gate. I thank you for your hard work. Unfortunately, city lord Baron, his hard work can only do so much. Pandora responded with a slight tinge of hostility as if the city lord was being proud of something he shouldn't be. She approached the table in front of them, Dirk just hanging behind her and gnawing on a strip of dried meat. 
This city is on its last legs, as I've noticed after observing for all of today. Your soldiers are fatigued despite the abundance of food, giving them, at best, another week of constant fighting before giving in. You are the sole rank 7, and you have no tier SIXS. They died protecting the city in the initial attacks, princess. The city lord suddenly snapped, as if to ensure Pandora wouldn't degrade their sacrifice. She just nodded. I figured as much. What I'm concerned about, city lord, is your lack of longevity. This city is crumbling, and soon enough you're going to be overrun. That's why we're targeting the monster general. Actually, believe it or not, the presence of the three monster generals on the outskirts of the hordes is the only thing keeping you alive right now. The city lord was silent as Pandora smiled. There are three monster generals that are fighting amongst themselves. One will come out victorious, becoming the true general. Until then, the majority of the monster's high-end strength is occupied with this civil war. Now, if we kill these generals while they're still weak, all the hordes will disperse. They'll be uncoordinated, but that will only end with all of them attacking the city instead of small armies. Those generals are holding them back, for now. But if we level the generals alive, they'll grow stronger until the last of them stands, then launching strategic offensives on the city. You pick up fast. So you know how abysmal your ending is unless you enact another plan. The city lord went silent under Pandora's sharp gaze. Seeing as how the city lord was being pressured, though, a captain beside them stepped forward in anger. Hey! Do not disrespect the city lord. We have only survived this long through his leadership. I'm sure that's true. Unfortunately, no amount of reverence you have for your crippled city lord will save your future selves. Hold your tongue, lady. Shing! Suddenly, a dozen soldiers unsheathed their weapons. The air of rage and hostility poured out, making it seem like they would all impale the princess regardless of her background or seductive beauty. The nearby captain even pressed his spear against her throat. For a moment, everything was still, the slightest movement threatening to send the room into a frenzy. It was clear that everyone was on edge, exhausted and limited in patience. Pandora merely stood there, staring at the city lord with a wide smile. Her ruby eyes bored into the man, and for a moment, everyone saw past the graceful and royal princess. She almost looked, a bit thrilled by the turn of events, her smile sending chills down everyone's spines. Then, the city lord tore his gaze away from her, glancing at where Dirk was supposed to be. The only thing he saw was a black cat, its golden eyes peering into him. Stand down. The city lord commanded, and most of the soldiers sheathed their weapons. Except the captain, who still had an enraged face. City Lord, this impudent wench should be tossed to the monsters outside the gates. The captain snarled as he pressed further. Pandora's pointed teeth were further exposed as he drew blood. For a moment, he glanced to her side, seeing spite. When he looked into that cat's eyes, he was enraptured. The next moment though, he felt a sharp prick on the back of his neck. Chills shot through his body, suddenly feeling like his life was going to slip away. Who? He spun around, pulling back his spear and slashing behind him. The spear was stopped by an armored hand though, a knee shooting to its shaft and snapping it in half. Dirk grabbed the captain's arm after breaking the spear, spinning him back around and slamming his head into the table in front of him. The captain struggled but couldn't budge Dirk's hold, forced down by the lock in his own joints. Dirk's head turned up, staring at the city lord. Dirk's eyes were covered by that cloth but the city lord could still feel a piercing gaze, one that went further than vision. The city lord gulped. Even at his peak, he had never felt anything like Dirk's current aura. It was an amazingly threatening, not filled with bursting bloodlust or guttural rage. It was quiet, almost invisible. There wasn't any kind of killing intent or pressure. The city lord didn't even feel like his life was in danger. Despite the knife Dirk now had at the captain's throat, it didn't seem like he had any intention of killing the man, either. But that's exactly what alarmed the city lord. That utter disregard for life. The ability to kill without any form of emotion or motivation.
the disconnect between an obvious threat and a non-existent sense of danger made him shiver inwardly, like knowing a ghost was drifting around you but being unable to see it. And that wasn't even considering his uncanny ability to disappear from under their noses. You surprise me, Dirk Strider. I had thought you would be more like your elder brother, more like your father. But, it seems you inherited your mother's side. A compliment, of course, considering her abilities that were greater than mine, even at my prime. Hmm. Dirk just hummed at the city lord's appeasing words. Then, everyone heard a clap, turning their heads to Pandora. I'm sorry, but if we could get back down to business. City lord. I suggest you remove any emotional soldiers from the room before you tell me exactly how you've planned on pulling this city out of its hellish pit. Very well. He nodded after a moment of silence, dismissing everyone but his highest advisors and officers. Dirk let his hostage go as well, the captain leaving without being able to look back at Dirk. After Pandora's small wound healed after a mere several seconds, they all gathered around the table. While Dirk remaining behind everyone was unsettling, nobody minded as Pandora bored into the city lord, prompting him to spill his secrets. Chapter 121, Blossom A portal, huh? I knew your emperor wasn't as stupid as he made himself seem. Pandora chuckled, her captivating voice lowering the guards of those around her. Her words were anything but soothing though, making some clench their teeth in anger. But they held it in the city lord had explained his simple plan. Turns out, he was given the materials and personnel necessary to build a teleporter that could connect them to any other teleporter in the Horizon Empire. It was a pretty massive portal, and it wasn't that much of a secret at this point considering most of the city had been reduced to ruin. There was only so much secrecy one could maintain in such a situation. But considering Pandora was the princess of the Dark Kingdom, this was information better kept under wraps. Unfortunately, circumstances compelled the city lord to tell her. He planned on finishing the portal that had been under continuous construction for the past few weeks. It was actually almost done, and upon finishing, they would be able to receive reinforcements. The city lord also had an artifact that allowed him long-distance communication with certain people in the capital, and he had been promised reinforcements should he get the portal operational. Pandora had a similar artifact. Turns out, while not widespread, these artifacts were popular among the nobility, and for good reason. With this information, Pandora had a much better picture of what the city lord had been aiming for, and how they needed to adapt. Now, this was a battle of attrition. They needed to hold out long enough for the portal to finish. The city lord estimated another week, at most, before it was done. However, this amount of time didn't solve their dilemma with the monster generals. If we wait too long, the monster generals will finish their civil war, and they'll become too powerful for us to handle. If we kill them now, the armies will disperse and will be subject to a large siege. Either way, we risk decimation. Pandora rubbed her chin and pondered, as did the others. She was only silent for several seconds though before shrugging. Very well. There's only one option, then. We need to kill the generals. What? How could we do that? You just said we'll be sieged if we kill them. Another officer spoke up, surprised by her unhesitant decision. She glanced back at him, her gaze not derisive but dismissive. It's the only option because it's the one we can control. Who knows how powerful those monster generals can become? And how can we be sure they'll actually kill each other until only one remains? They might just stop when two of them remain and then attack together. Regardless, sitting and waiting can only bring more uncertainty. But if we kill the generals, we can predict the reaction of the monsters. We can prepare accordingly for a siege, and then trigger it, rather than wait and test our luck. Pandora explained simply. For a while, nobody said anything. The officers present obviously knew the threat the monster generals posed. They had severely wounded a rank 7, and killed several tier SIXS. If they were allowed to grow unchecked, they could slaughter the remaining high tier power of the city. The rest of the soldiers would be chickens on the chopping block, just waiting to die. There would be no hope. On the other hand, defending against an invasion, 
especially one they could plan for, gave them greater chances. It might come at the cost of many soldiers, but they were beyond the point of worrying about losses. They weren't just backed into a corner, but surrounded with nowhere to escape. It was do or die. The only reason they didn't immediately agree with the plan was because it came from Pandora's haughty mouth. Not even the city lord wanted to immediately agree. But when he thought more and more, he realized that Pandora wasn't as stupid as he wished, and it really was their only plan of action. Why did this princess have to be smart? The city lord rubbed his eyes, glancing deadpan at Pandora's blank face. I'm not opposed to this plan. Good. I'd be concerned otherwise. She smiled, twirling her hair with a finger. Now, all you need to do is begin preparations. Start setting up barricades, laying traps, and preparing your soldiers. You have, two days before the invasion. Why two days? Because on the second night, those generals are dying, whether you're ready or not. The city lord frowned. It was almost as if Pandora were threatening him with her words, not trying to help them. Sensing the hostility, Pandora just rolled her eyes. It's a deadline, city lord. Deadlines can be a valuable tool, instilling a sense of urgency that promotes efficiency and hard work. And since I'm the one placing down this deadline, I hope you work with your people quickly. Use your time wisely, because as soon as I send this man out, the siege shall commence. Though, you don't have to worry too much. Everything will occur at opportune times. Anyway. She suddenly clapped, spinning on her heel and turning her back on the officers. My partner and I are hungry, so excuse us. Dirk? Hmm. Dirk hummed as followed, not having uttered a word during the entire meeting. He was indeed very hungry, strips of meat only doing so much to stave off his rumbling stomach. At that moment though, an officer violently shook his head, as if he had been in a cloudy daze the entire time. He gritted his teeth at Pandora's exiting figure. Wait, wait. Why are we just letting this arrogant princess order us around? Since when does she hold any authority here? I could just leave. Pandora spoke softly, coming to a stop in the doorway. You know, I didn't come here completely willingly. It was Dirk here who made me feel guilty enough to help. And I've done nothing but give my opinion and assistance. But, if you don't want it, then we can just leave. She glanced back, her glowing red eyes boring into the officer. At her words, even the city lord felt a certain amount of dread. It was as if they needed her here to survive. They didn't want her to leave, despite her arrogance and commanding attitude. The threat of her abandoning them seemed to be worse than that of the monster hordes outside. None of them could understand this feeling. It pulled on their minds for a while until Pandora stepped away. When she finally disappeared, the officers let out long breaths. She's powerful. The city lord mumbled. Since she had done nothing to fight the monsters unlike Dirk, he had assumed she was weaker than him, especially after that display Dirk put on with the unruly captain. But her ability to pressure not out of sheer power, but out of psychological suppression, indicated a different kind of depth. She was definitely no pushover, possibly being one of the most powerful within the city. If only their greatest hadn't died early on. The city lord lamented the cruel battles that had first reduced the city to ruin. Even he, a rank seven, had been cut down to nothing more than a strong cripple. Anyone who could compare to him had died after the initial outbreak. It was worse than a war, with indiscriminate bloodshed and savage brutality. Begin preparations. You know the plan. Start relaying orders tonight. With one final order, the city lord retired, the day taking its toll on him. The officers rushed off, having recovered from their meeting with the vampire princess. Good. So they took my advice. Pandora meandered across the walls, dressed in a casual and reserved set of clothes that looked suspiciously close to sweats and a t-shirt. Her deep purple hair was also tied into a ponytail, and it swayed with the breezes of wind that occasionally graced her form. Dirk was beside her, and they both scanned the surroundings for different reasons. Pandora watched as both civilians and soldiers alike rushed to set up barricades under the command of their captains. 
mages were putting in the most work, conjuring barriers of rock and stone which were armed with long spikes and pitfalls. Even water mages were conjuring vast gullies with the help of earth mages, establishing more than just solid barriers that could break down. They started at the walls, reinforcing any damaged sections as they had done for weeks and then adding some extra defense. Then, they established fallback barriers at three different points within the city, each one closer to the center than the last. Pandora was just happy that the city lord didn't disregard her, and that the captains were willingly putting in their effort to organize this defense. On the other hand, Dirk was watching both inside and outside the walls. Occasionally he glanced to the hordes in the distance, their figures barely visible in his man of vision. They were a few miles away, and they only usually attacked in the afternoon. It was lucky that they had something of a schedule. Otherwise, this city would have been overrun should they just attack whenever they wished. This predictable nature was in fact due to the generals, and as Pandora stated, was also the reason this city was still standing. They couldn't handle an all-out assault. At least, not yet they couldn't. Small groups of soldiers occasionally ran past Dirk and Pandora, almost always glancing at the princess as they passed. Perhaps it was her odd clothing, or perhaps it was her beauty that shone through even such a casual wardrobe. She was an eye-catcher no matter where she went. As for Dirk, he was barely noticeable beside her who pulled eyes like a magnet. Still, those who glanced at him shot him looks of nothing but respect. Dirk had clearly showcased his uncanny ability to handle hordes of savage beasts and come out unscathed. Inhuman reflexes, near omniscient awareness, and ruthless attacks. He was the perfect killing machine on the battlefield. On top of that, rumor was circulating around that he was the son of Marquis Strider, a renowned name in all military circles. Dirk didn't know exactly what prestige his family name held because he was rather sheltered for most of his life. But they did. These two partners drifted around the compound for almost the entire morning. Pandora would take time in intervals to observe the generals beyond the walls, getting a read on their patterns and behavior. Dirk didn't bother with that since he couldn't see that far anyway. Instead, he analyzed the entire city. Spite was on his shoulder as well, scanning everything and creating a virtual map that could be overlaid in Dirk's vision for heightened awareness. After all, recording the layout of the battlefield was a vital function of AI interfaces for super soldiers. When noon finally came though, the sun shining at its highest and brightest point, the monster generals made their move. As if deciding on a ceasefire, a large wave of monsters rushed the city walls. The west wall had it the worst, and likewise had the most troops stationed there. Dirk also perched atop the edge of those walls, watching, waiting as those hordes charged like a stampede. He didn't plan on jumping down yet. The enemy had way too much momentum. He'd wait until it was broken. The ground shook, pebbles on the walls rattling against the stone floor as the paws of monsters raged against the terrain. Dirk could sense the man of all the mages around him swirl to life, his mana vision flaring with all elements and colors. In a way, mana vision could be just as vibrant as regular vision. He was beginning to see that, the longer he gazed through the lenses of this magical world. Bang! The walls shook as the hordes slammed against the stone. An entire section of the wall was directly demolished as hundreds of bodies slammed against the defenses. While the frontmost monsters were trapped in trenches, and those behind were impaled by spikes, there were so many that they simply kept moving forward. Sheer strength. The horde was like a battering ram. It almost seemed like nothing could stop it as an entire portion of the wall tumbled and reduced to boulders. But it did. With that section, the horde came to a stop. They clustered on top of each other outside the walls. Every inch of space was a target. So the mages, withholding nothing, launched the largest scale spells they could. Fire. A captain roared, his voice shaking everyone's ears. All fire mages stepped up with his command, and spells washed over the ground below them. Screams could be heard as every monster was roasted alive, the smell of burning hair and flesh wafting upward with the smoke. For a while, the front of the wall blazed, the magical fire spreading from monster to monster, their bodies fueling the raging blaze. Then, it gradually died out. 
the captain roared once more. Earth! Another command, and massive spikes appeared in the air. They formed heavy bodies and sharp tips, before being dropped. Screech! Even more monsters screamed as they were impaled to the floor. Hundreds of spikes riddled the battlefield, and it seemed like those mindless armies had been bested with strategy. But then, Dirk could sense the birds. Aerial beasts came swooping over, threatening to snatch soldiers like little rats and drop them to their doom. The captain saw this, and roared with a bit more urgency. Water mages! Bring them down! With that command, Dirk felt the humidity of the atmosphere rise, becoming swampy. All around him, both small blobs of water, water blades, and rivers of water were conjured. They formed a sea of water in the sky. He was quite stunned by the organized display. And then, it all came down. The rivers of water crashed into all the enemies below, slamming them to the floor along with all that liquid weight. The spheres and blades of water targeted everything else in the sky, precisely shooting down those aerial enemies. Only the blades of water did damage to those aerial monsters. As for the spheres, they merely knocked them out of the sky. But that was enough. The earth mages, still hard at work, targeted all these aerial beasts with spikes that nailed them to the floor. And with a blessing of fire, they were reduced to ash. Not bad. Not bad at all. Pandora clapped with a wide smile, catching the attention of the captain for a mere moment. Good coordination, obvious experience. They've done this several times before. Unfortunately, this kind of tactic can't be sustained. It's good for breaking momentum, but not long-term battle. Over the next few hours, the mages will dwindle, forcing the body refiners to step up and risk themselves in direct battle. The mages also become susceptible to attack, and perhaps one or two get picked off as they retreat. Over the course of many days, citizens and armies get devastated, only getting worse with each passing battle and death. Still, this is about the best they could do. Her words seemed to envision the gradual downfall of this city, as the nearby soldiers grimaced in anguish. Suddenly, Dirk smacked her shoulder, causing her to recoil. Hey! What was that for? You're smart, so shut up and quit breaking their spirits with the obvious past. Unless you're trying to get your plan to fail. Hmph, fine. She huffed after glancing at him for a moment, crossing her arms. At least Dirk's reprimanding seemed to help their fallen spirits lift a bit more, because the nearby soldiers decided to shake their heads and continue fighting. After so long, so many days of desperate battle that only left their city in ruins, each of these soldiers was on the verge of breaking down. Even rookies were now veterans hardened through an apocalyptic situation. This was no better than a war, nearly all the citizens in this prosperous place ravaged and eaten by mindless monsters. Hell, it could be said that it was worse than a war, since at least people had a conscience. Civilians wouldn't be massacred without reason. But monsters, they didn't care. They even ate each other, let alone innocent people. To watch this city degrade under constant attacks, watching their comrades and people be savagely cut apart and eaten alive, would break the minds of any soldier. The only reason these people kept fighting was because the only other option was death. Dirk knew all this. He knew war. Just because he had been hardened to it didn't mean he didn't understand. So he decided to keep Pandora in check, she who either didn't know or didn't care about what war did to people. But that wasn't all he would do. This was a war. And super soldiers could turn wars on their heads. He turned and walked to the captain who roared out orders. They were a bit more tame than before, accommodating the limited mana reserves of his mages. Dirk took a spot by his side, waiting for a gap in his yelling before speaking. Captain. Cool it at the base of the wall. I'm going down. The captain turned back, giving Dirk a hesitant look before sighing. Very well. Good luck, Strider. Don't worry about me. Just focus on everything else. With those words, Dirk approached the edge of the wall. As he stepped up, Obsidius was called through their bond. That little black blob bounced around his body before splashing against his clothes. 
it rapidly spread, gaining material from seemingly nowhere and covering his entire body. That metallic body armor sealed every gap, making it airtight before hardening. Everyone, even the mages, turned their heads to watch him as he stood tall on the wall's edge. In his hands appeared two short swords. Then, his anima activated, aura spilling into obsidious and making the armor glow with complex golden lines that ran across his body. Then, he bent down. His legs bulged with power, those lines on his armor pulsing with power. Bang! The wall shook with his jump. Even Pandora couldn't help but smile as he soared through the air, free falling into that endless horde of mindless beasts. His short swords were pointed down as he fell becoming coated with a thin layer of golden aura, ready to pierce through even metal. The monsters below noticed this beacon of power as it flew toward them. Eyes behind him, claws and savage teeth bared below him, rising to meet their prey. And blood blossomed. Chapter 122, Dark Once again, you single-handedly held back the monsters yourself. I was responsible for perhaps 40% of the work. The fact that you come close to matching an entire organized army of mages is astonishing enough. Pandora chuckled as Obsidius revealed Dirk's body. His breathing was steady, though a bit labored. His heart was also beating with powerful pulses. Dirk's body ached, and all his energy was sapped. He didn't seem to care though, moving as if he didn't just fight an entire army of monsters. He and Pandora started walking back to the castle in the center of the city. As they did, Dirk pulled every eye. Every soldier eyed him with more awe than respect. They shook their heads, refusing to believe a single man had done what he did. He had killed close to 4,000 monsters over the course of seven hours. By now, night had already fallen, and the monsters were close to retreating. The rest could be handled by the soldiers. Still, Dirk's lone effort had felled nearly half the total kill count and it wasn't because he was atrociously powerful. He didn't have overwhelming attacks that sliced hundreds in half with every swing. He didn't have grand magic that could incinerate thousands with a single conjuring. His secret? He just didn't stop. He fought for seven hours straight. Every second, his actions were devoted to killing a monster. He only rested a single time, and that was to scarf down an entire meal before jumping back in the fray. He hadn't been out of the fight for more than five minutes. Not only was his energy inhuman, but his focus was unnaturally strong. He was able to properly allocate every ounce of his energy, not so much as wasting a drop over every hour of fighting. Even as he got tired, he maintained. He didn't deviate, he didn't overexert. He just continued fighting as if he weren't tired. And when he wanted to pull out, he did so. Like the previous day, his effort had allowed these armies to hold back the hordes, keeping them outside the walls and reducing casualties. But this time, his performance was even better. His skill seemed to increase since the day prior. His use of those short swords was superior, sharper, more deliberate and smooth. It wasn't as choppy as before. He was learning the weapon, developing his own direct style of swordplay. And then there was his magic. By spreading his attacks across mana and anima, he was able to efficiently use these two sources of energy, drawing out his longevity for so long. If it were just magic, he might be able to last three hours while pushing his mana lungs. And just his anima? Four hours. Add the longevity of those two energy pools, and the result was seven hours of fighting. Granted, none of the monsters were above tier or rank four, so he was allowed to pull off this performance anything stronger, and he would be exerting far more energy per enemy. But all this meant that even though he didn't look like it, Dirk was deathly hungry. He got out and stopped because he had reached his absolute limit, and desperately needed food. Pandora knew this of course, and she had brought the car around a long time ago. And there were pocket rings filled with food, some filled with concentrated anima and some bursting with elemental mana. Jumping in the trunk, Dirk didn't hesitate to grab a ring and pull out all the platters within. Pandora watched him with a smile, seemingly finding something curious or amusing as he ravenously devoured the food. He didn't care. She often did weird stuff. 
sudden exclamations at nothing, laughing at her own internal jokes. Inside her mind was an entire world of her own, and honestly, Dirk didn't care to enter it. He just let her be most of the time. In front of him were plates of cooked food. The rings Pandora brought had the magical functions of preserving food and any items within, so a cooked meal would stay that way until brought back out. And naturally, she had people cooking high-class food for them before leaving, so everything inside the rings was something you'd find at the nicest restaurants in the Dark Kingdom's capital. As he ate, Dirk gave a glance to Pandora, causing her eyes to scrunch and curve into crescents. He found this kindness odd. He had pissed her off right before leaving. Didn't she still care about that? Her attitude could change rather quickly, and he knows she didn't forget. Still, she could smile at him as if she were in love despite how angry he made her. He didn't get it. He felt bad though. Although he didn't want to believe it, Pandora had gradually led him to believe that she really was different from the psycho on Earth. Sure she still had that mind of madness but her emotions, her logic, it was more human. Dirk didn't blame her for her past. She was driven basically insane by the Super Soldier program. It was their fault. Still, he didn't know how much had really changed in her. And until he was sure, he could never be too careful. But he also had emotions. He didn't like making her mad, not that he cared too much if he did but when he saw this face of hers, it sparked conflict within him. After giving her that glance, his face turned back down, grabbing another slice of rich meat and stuffing it in his mouth. I don't drink potions because of Azura. His sudden words surprised Pandora, and she listened intently. While I was there, I was constantly tortured. Broken bones, scrambled organs. They very nearly severed my limbs several times using nothing but their whips. They had no problems burning me or impaling me. This happened every day, and after every time, I'd get healed by powerful potions. Those potions repaired me entirely. They broke me down, and healed me right back up. Hundreds of times over. Dirk grabbed a loaf of bread layered with melted cheese, greedily chomping down. Anyway, after I got out, you could say that I had a relapse. Apparently your body can become reliant on potions. And mine, well, it was entirely reliant on those potions. So when I didn't ingest anymore, my body began breaking down. Long story short, I would have died without the Emperor's help and my restoration trait, something I acquired after my body adapted to not having the potion. Pandora didn't immediately speak, watching as Dirk inhaled the entire loaf of bread. She understood now, why he didn't so much as touch potions. She let out a light breath, her eyes dimming just a bit. You know, I made those potions personally. The ones I was going to give you. Really? Dirk stopped eating, looking up at her with surprise. She bobbed her head and climbed out of her seat, taking a spot in front of him. I did, but I understand now why you slapped it out of my hand and fed it to the stone wall. Though. I can't help but be impressed. By what? Dirk tilted his head. She looked him in the eye. By the fact that someone was actually able to traumatize you, a super soldier. I know nobody that can match your strength of mind, and yet, someone was actually able to scar you. Dirk frowned at her words, his gaze becoming a bit colder. Before he could rebuke her though, she reached forward and placed her hand on his head, combing his hair. Her words were soft. But, your scars show just how strong you've become. Someone traumatized the most stubborn person I know, and yet he came out of it even stronger. You were able to survive the torture of a tier 8. And those scars, within your mind. I see them. I see just how much you've gone through, and triumphed over. Her words, were shockingly encouraging. Her hand that ran through his hair and stroked his cheek threatened to turn him to butter. And that soothing voice put his mind at ease, wiping away all his hostility that had threatened to burst. Being encouraged and sympathized with like this, it was different. Different from the kind of motherly comfort and affection Cecilia gave him. This was more intimate. I reminded him of Ava. Dirk's gaze sharpened, but he couldn't help the emotions that threatened to reveal themselves. 
Still, he may allow Pandora to comfort him, but that didn't mean he would allow himself to be vulnerable before her. So he sobered up. Even Pandora seemed to sense his change, as she pulled away with a light smile. I'll make sure you have plenty of food to eat. As for potions, well, they have many uses that go beyond healing and stamina replenishment. With the right ingredients and preparation, some can transform your body, enhancing various parts of it. If the day comes when I prepare such a potion, you can think of ingesting it then. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. He responded with a bit of thought. After that, he eyed the girl in front of him. He often overlooked it, but she was seriously gorgeous. He almost hated that fact. He couldn't help but see it as a pretty shell that covered a dark core. But, perhaps it wasn't all that dark. Dirk pondered for a bit before letting out a sigh. I might regret this, but would you like some blood? He spoke while uncovering his clavicle. He knew that Pandora loved his blood, and she had been cooperative and nice. He just wanted to do something nice for her. And there wasn't much he could give her that she didn't already have. Besides his own blood, of course. Pandora was naturally shocked at the offer. He often refused to even let her touch him, let alone get his blood. She had kept her distance and didn't push too far, despite their blood pact. But he was actually offering it to her. She eyed him, unable to hide her desire. Are you sure? You'll be a bit weakened. He frowned. I know I will, so you better get some before I change my mind. He, then I'll oblige. She chuckled, pouncing on top of him and baring her fangs. Those fangs, while not large, weren't small either. After she straddled him and hugged his body, he felt those teeth poke into his clavicle, targeting the artery under his flesh. Mmm. She let out a long moan as his blood streamed into her mouth. As she poked directly into his artery, his blood flowed uninhibited, allowing her to drink it like water. If it were anyone else, the amount she drank would render them either severely anemic or completely immobile. They'd pass out from shock, and it would take months to completely recover what they'd lost. She drank an entire third of his blood supply over the course of a few minutes, sucking on his clavicle like there was no tomorrow. Luckily, Dirk could take this amount of blood loss without much reaction. Plus, it would all be regenerated by the next morning with restoration, so he didn't care much. Of course, he'd have to eat more food for fuel, but that was an easy and enjoyable pastime. When she was finally done, she pulled away. Her teeth sealed the wounds she created, preventing his artery from spraying blood everywhere. She licked her lips and teeth, her expression positively blissful, if not a bit too heated. While on top of him, she looked into his eyes, as if the cloth did nothing to block their gazes. He could feel her warm breath brush across his face as she lingered there. The strength of their soul bond, the transmission of Pandora's heat, seduction that graced her every move, threatening to pull him in tight. Luckily, Dirk had superhuman willpower. When Pandora looked at him, she felt his, shockingly small amount of passion or heat. It was like she was mounting a monk. She glanced behind her before raising her brow. Are you sure everything of yours actually works? It works when I want it to. Dirk snickered when he realized where her gaze was pointed at. Sounds exciting. She brightened with curiosity though, earning a firm pair of hands that lifted and threw her on the mattress. Dirk sighed while climbing into the front seat, ignoring Pandora's pleasure over rough treatment. Around the city, both civilians and soldiers worked tirelessly in order to raise more defensive lines. Pandora had given them a deadline, and it seemed like the city lord was serious about meeting it. So two days after Pandora had given them her plan, it seemed like just about everything was finished. An air of anxiousness formed at the dawn of the second evening. Tonight was the night Pandora said that the monster generals were dying, whether they were ready or not. One comforting fact though was the lesser amounts of monsters beyond the walls. With Dirk's lone effort that culled thousands alongside the soldiers, the hordes beyond seemed thinner. But there were still tens of thousands, all of them being controlled in some way by the monster generals to do their bidding. Screams could occasionally be heard in the distance, the flashes of magic and light of fire flaring on the horizon. 
Pandora watched this while atop the western wall. It was deep into the night, around 3 a.m. As she had observed, this was the time when the monsters were least active. And it was their time to act. All right, super soldier. Time to work. Don't call me that. A dull voice sounded from beside her. Dirk sat with his legs hung off the wall, his gaze focused on the distance. He had constantly been focused on refining his long-distance man of vision, and he was gradually making progress. Over time, he had used his memory combined with the mana radiating off of objects to formulate colors in his mind. Along with the shapes he recognized and inherent material properties, he could make out even more than his vision allowed. For instance, metal. Dirk could sense metal mana, and as he found out, metal mana had its own set of properties. It was like how a single magical element could have many runes and spell formations, giving that single element a myriad of ways to be shaped and manipulated. He was using that logic in his vision. If a metal were a dull color, he could see that through its smooth surface, thick mana, and how the light reflected off of it using dark mana. If it were like copper, he would see those properties that were more conductive to heat as well as the different coloration. If it were like silver, then he could see the unique properties of silver alongside its brighter sheen. The mana seemed to mimic nature in a way. This was only visible though to those who looked deep enough into its nature. And this logic applied to all kinds of materials and properties. If someone's hair was green, Dirk could see the shadow of the color through dark mana and the color itself through earth mana. Plants could be seen this way, as all of them had large amounts of lively earth mana within them. All shades of brown were also visible. Reds were visible through fire mana. Dirk could even faintly sense the blues of water mana. Over time, Dirk was more and more surprised by the depth of mana and all its various properties and forms. It was like learning a language. As he experienced more and more, his comprehension rose and he began to reshape his worldview. Even in the distance, just as Pandora saw, Dirk could make out the flares of bright fire mana and the surges of earth mana as the landscape occasionally roiled. Even when he looked at Pandora herself, he could make out that deep purple hair and stunning red eyes. And, perhaps she had learned this from his mother, but Pandora started leaving traces of mana around herself, allowing her to be highlighted in his vision. Dirk was beginning to miss his vision less and less. He suddenly stood. Spite perked up on his shoulder. Pandora kept her gaze on the distance. My spell is ready. When I activate it, all the monster generals will be highlighted. You need to kill them all. If you leave one, then that one will take control of every monster around it and launch a coordinated attack on this city. And believe me, you don't want that. I've seen how they move, and it looked like they really do have some semblance of cunning. The city will fall if you mess up. Ah! Uh -huh. Dirk just hummed, as if he didn't care. He was no stranger to high-stakes missions. All right. Since you're ready, hold still for a second. Pandora suddenly waved her hand. Dirk could see the dark mana around him be washed away as light mana appeared from her hand. This light mana wrapped around his right hand before forming three magic circles, a rather advanced spell. Once it formed, the circles completed their circuit and occasionally pulsed with light mana. She looked at him. This is a beacon. It'll allow me to see where you are as well as tell you which direction to go. The closer you are to the first target, the more rapid the pulses get. I've tagged the first one. Once you make your first kill, the spell will activate and highlight the other two. They will know you're coming, so be prepared to slaughter your way to them. As for any other details. She smiled. I'll leave it to you. Feel free to wreak as much havoc as you want. Fine. With that, Dirk jumped down the wall. He saw where Pandora pointed. The eastern portion of the monster armies, where the first general was located. After hitting the ground with a thud, he charged. Obsidius wrapped around his body as he ran, and gradually, he disappeared from Pandora's sight. With stealth, he had gone dark. Not even Pandora could find him unless she used some light magic. She wouldn't see him again until he made his first kill. So she just watched, expectant of his performance. 
Chapter 123, Wolf General Dirk prowled through the monster hordes. He had run up to them, a large area upon the landscape where the generals and armies fought. This area was several square miles large, and even then there wasn't much room to move. The monsters out there were constantly running around. It was only for a few hours during the night that they retreated and went to sleep, everything becoming quiet. But even then, there would be monsters out patrolling, keeping an eye on the armies of the other generals. Dirk didn't aim for this time. Why? Because the armies weren't his concern. The monsters around the generals were the ones he needed to be concerned over. And those monsters around the general also had to sleep. However, they only did so while the armies were active. Pandora had surprised Dirk with some deep information. The monster armies slept around midnight, and they slept for close to four hours. After that, they would begin fighting again, and the guards would sleep under the protection of the raging armies. This was the window Dirk was aiming for. The time he headed out was just after the army started back up. With Obsidius around him and his stealth activated, he was able to weave through the armies completely undetected. Of course, he didn't have to evade monsters for long. Each of the generals were located an equal distance apart, thousands of monsters between them. Like most human generals, they placed themselves behind their armies. This also meant that their backs were the least guarded. So Dirk was sure to circle around, only needing to make his way through a few clusters of mindless monsters. The spell on his hand pulsed as he did so. It became more rapid as he got closer to the general. He could also feel a sense of direction from it. It wasn't long before he entered a small clearing. There were six large monsters in the middle of this clearing, the armies keeping their distance out of fear. Dirk inserted himself into this exclusion zone, just between the surrounding army and the general's guards. He could see the general as the spell on his hand dimmed. The general was sitting in the midst of its guards, chomping down on a large gorilla type monster. The figure of the general made Dirk frown in seriousness. It was a massive wolf. Its fur looked like metal as it bristled with pure violence and savagery. Its fangs tore into its prey's flesh like it was rubber, crunching bones along the way as if it didn't even notice them. Even its claws could poke through those bones as it grabbed different limbs of the monster. Dirk could feel earth and metal mana from this wolf, along with light mana. Pandora had already told him that all three of the generals had the light attribute. This light attribute was how they controlled the surrounding armies, using strings of mental manipulation to guide them. So it wasn't a surprise seeing the light mana. Dirk wasn't even nervous over the unbridled, rabid behavior of the wolf. It was the tier 5 mana coming from its body that gave him a headache. Dirk was barely tier and rank 4. This monster was absolutely at least an entire tier above him. As for its rank, he wouldn't be sure until they fought. Still, by the way the wolf casually tore its prey limb from limb, he assumed it wasn't lacking. But although Dirk was lesser in sheer power, he wasn't a normal mage or warrior. Asterisk growling. Asterisk. The wolf growled as it finished stripping the last slices of meat from its food. Its snout dripped with fresh blood as it raised its head, looking around. Dirk stood tall in front of the guards that surrounded the general. Each of the guards stared at the surrounding monster armies with ferocity, but their menacing gazes were clearly a mask to hide their fear over the general beside them. Dirk could even see one trembling. The wolf eyed this particular guard, and then approached. It was slow as it made its way closer, its claws treading the ground and nose sticking itself upon the back of this fearful guard. The wolf general sniffed its guard, as if inspecting it. Raising its paw, a claw pointed itself and placed itself upon the guard's back, tracing down and leaving an obvious trail of blood. Dirk watched the guard yelp in pain, and couldn't help but feel odd. The sight reminded him of Delia, how she liked to play with him drawing wounds across his body as she spoke with him. Unfortunately, this guard didn't have the life insurance he did. As if the elp had displeased the general, the wolf opened its maw and chomped down on its neck. It was fast. Dirk's gaze hardened as he saw the wolf's teeth clamp down with surprising agility. It wasn't any speed that he couldn't handle, 
but combined with its obviously high tier, this wolf was turning out to be a difficult opponent. With that single chomp, the wolf killed its guard, reducing the number of its guards to five. It didn't even eat this guard, just retreating with blood dripping from its fangs. Then, the general laid down upon a patch of leaves and grass, a makeshift bed perhaps. Once it put its head down, the other guards followed. Dirk's hand twitched as he watched. Then, he took a deep breath. His heart slowed. His mana vision sharpened. A weapon appeared in his hands. It was a large and heavy axe, crude in design but built with obvious power. One of the many weapons Pandora had brought along, this axe's blade was composed of Tier V geode, a pure metal with an affinity to the earth element. With this weapon, Dirk could freely inject his mana into it and increase its magical properties. It could even be used as a medium for spellcasting, not unlike his pistol Stigma. After equipping the axe, he gave a command inwardly. Go! Happy hunting! Spite jumped out of his body, the cat circling the group of guards. Dirk also circled around, his presence drifting through the shadows of the night. Suddenly, the wolf perked its head up. It looked before it, between two of its guards. Its black eyes rested upon a feline. That small figure with majestic black hair and golden stripes looked directly at it, its brilliant eyes enrapturing it for but a mere moment. The two only stared at each other for a bit. As Dirk knew, the monster generals weren't mindless. It was as if monsters earn intelligence through power. This wolf, along with the other two generals, was smart enough to utilize tactics and cunning as well as lead its armies. They could even bring down a city with a rank 7 guarding it. They were not to be underestimated. So the wolf didn't immediately attack. It evaluated the cat before it, wondering how it suddenly appeared and what its purpose was. It was curious, but also wary. And then, it felt chills. The instincts of a beast forged through the fires of savage slaughter warned it. It was in mortal danger. The cat in front of it narrowed its golden eyes, taking a step forward and toward the wolf. The wolf kept its attention on the cat for a second longer than it should have. When it finally spun around to face the source of the chills, it was met with a deep blade. The mana in its body exploded, doing everything in its absolute power to evade this attack. A W O O. Shing! Metal blades and spikes surged from the wolf's body and the ground around it. Several attacks were aimed at the area before it and the rest were focused on blocking the incoming blade. Even its own fur was utilized, blades materializing from its body, called upon for a heavy cost. The axe was barely diverted away from its skull, the blade crashing through every last defense before gracing its shoulder, drawing a deep wound that severed half of its front arm. Along with its previous movement, the wolf launched itself backward. The other guards also spurred alive, rudely wakened and furious at the one who would dare attack their general. Dirk appeared in that moment, taking a step to steady himself before squaring with the guards who had surrounded their general. Then, he vanished before their eyes, drifting like a ghost into the shadows. The wolf growled, barking at one of its guards. Grack! A guard that took the shape of a ferocious lizard let out a cry before opening its mouth. It reminded Dirk a lot of the fire skinks he once knew and loved. Fire bellowed from the lizard's mouth, washing through the land and surrounding the general. At the same time, the general called upon more of its spikes blades surging from the ground and creating a barrier of death around them. Metal and fire raged for a few moments. The lizard was wholly focused on torching the enemy that could be anywhere around it. Its fire spread far enough to torch the armies running around them, not stopping until the surrounding 100 meters was nothing but a sea of flame. As it was doing so though, the wolf suddenly felt more chills. It suddenly grabbed the lizard with its mouth and flung its head around. Slice. An axe blade cut down, cutting through the lizard that the wolf had used as a shield. The axe slowed and was unable to pierce through the extra defenses that the wolf mustered. Dirk appeared right before the wolf, in the midst of the guards. He hadn't distanced himself. He had moved in. The wolf dropped the bisected lizard before lunging toward its enemy. It was much slower now though. 
Dirk's first attack had forced the wolf to utilize the mana within itself in a dangerous way, hurting its own body in the process of saving its life. And even then, Dirk had disabled one of its front limbs, making it far more unsteady on its own feet. It was debilitating, and perhaps the wolf knew it, but it would really lose its life should it not take the initiative. Dirk waved his axe as the wolf lunged toward him. Crescent blades formed in the air, the blades spinning and heading toward Dirk from all odd directions. At the same time, the wolf threatened to chomp down on Dirk, tearing him apart. It was giving him no room and sparing no amount of mana or energy to kill him. To this, Dirk moved in as well. He met the wolf, and dodged the moss that tried to clamp down on his body. At the same time, he swung his axe outward, knocking away three of the crescent blades that tried to fly over and slice him apart. Dirk tackled the wolf to the floor, taking out a knife with his free hand and stabbing the wolf in the gut over and over again. The wolf cried out as it slashed at Dirk with its claws, each claw screeching across obsidious armor and cutting it open, slicing into Dirk's skin. Blades also surged from the ground and tried to impale him. Dirk reinforced the armor with his anima after several wounds opened on his body, causing golden circuits to appear on the black armor. And along with Earth Guard creating metal plates around his body to block the spikes, he used the wolf's body itself to guard himself from its own attacks. During all this, Dirk's hand moved over a dozen times, and each time the knife was planted into the wolf's body. Dirk stabbed several vital areas, and once he felt it was enough, he stopped evading and grabbed the wolf, throwing its large body to the side. And as it tumbled, the pistol appeared in his hand. It was steadily aimed, his arm unmoving even as the wounds across his body sent pain through his body. The magic circuits on the body of the gun glowed. Zip! A metal bullet flew out, taking an entire 10% of Dirk's mana supply with it. It pierced through the wolf's eye socket, making the monster collapse limply just as it started to regain itself. Just like that, it was dead. Target 1 terminated. Acquire confirmation and move on. Spite spoke within his mind, her instructions familiar to Dirk. And he moved on instinct, taking a second to behead the wolf before storing his weapon and head in the pocket ring. After that, he disappeared from view. The guards couldn't even react before he was gone. They did nothing to protect their general, but that was only because the battle was beyond their abilities to contribute to. Then, Pandora's spell suddenly activated. Her voice also appeared in his mind. Good job. Nice and quick, in exchange for a few wounds. Make these other ones quicker, because their power with the light element grows with less competition. The light element thrives through control. With a cryptic ending, the spell on Dirk's hand exploded. Light mana washed across the fields of armies, and with it, Dirk was suddenly opened up to a new world. The spell highlighted all the strings of mind control that the generals used to manipulate the armies. And all these strings converged upon two locations, obviously the generals. Only, the generals seemed to realize what had happened, as those strings began to spread like a virus taking more and more monsters under their wings. Dirk felt odd, seeing that. The Dark Element was often seen as the manipulator. The Dark Schemer that sought to take over through underhanded means. Although there wasn't any discrimination against Dark Mages since they were so valuable, there was no doubt a certain stereotype associated with them. Take Geral for example. Dirk was sure that Geral was the textbook example of how Dark Mages were seen. The dark element was inherently chaotic, and it turned its mages chaotic. People often thought that it was the dark mages one needed to be wary of. They might curse you, try to turn you into a minion to do their bidding. But now, it was the light element doing just that. Dirk's mana vision could see the light element taking control of thousands of monsters. The monsters seemed to struggle against it, but it was futile as they all eventually succumbed to the rule of their new masters. This level of mind control far surpassed that of the dark element. Dirk wondered what would have happened to him if Azura was a light mage instead of a dark one. Could he have taken control of Dirk if that were the case? What kind of havoc could he have sown through the Horizon Empire as he manipulated armies of assassins to do his bidding? As for those with the light attribute, like Pandora, 
the people he needed to be wary of were different than he imagined. Dirk acted fast. He moved along the outskirts of the armies, making his way toward the next general. He followed all those strings of light mana, quickly arriving at their nexus. At some point though, the general he was nearing released another surge of light mana. The wave of light mana washed over him, directly disrupting his stealth and revealing him to the world. The monsters around him, as well as the general who could feel the void of dark mana he created, turned their attention. And with him revealed, he was unable to vanish from their sights again. The light mana focused on him. The generals felt the threat he posed. They knew he had already killed one. So they attacked. Thousands of monsters surged toward him from all directions. From the air, from the ground, spells of all elements threatened to wipe him out. But they were too weak. Too slow. With a step, Dirk divided himself. The spells crashed upon his body, but when the dust settled he was gone. Instead, his body had reappeared several meters away. Void walking. Seeing the monsters converge on him, Dirk equipped two of his short swords. He thought back to Pandora's words as well. She told him to prepare, that he would need to slaughter his way after making his first kill. It looked like she was right. He shook his head. And then his hand shot out, burying his sword into the heart of a monster that tried to slash him in two. After that, he shot forward, stepping through the hordes and making his way toward the generals. Pandora watched from afar. She watched his figure as it weaved, as spells and the elements surged across the sky. As the generals prepared themselves for their inevitable deaths. She smiled and waited for the vision in her mind to play out just as she imagined it. Chapter 124 Eagle General Dirk's short sword cut apart flesh, the rubbery hides of the monsters before him rending in two before spilling blood. He dodged all the claws that slashed down, all the spells that flew with reckless abandon. The monsters hurt each other more than him with their chaotic attacks. A ball of fire aimed for him would soon hit the monster behind him. He used these to his advantage. His awareness seemed omniscient as he bounced from monster to monster. He constantly moved forward, whether by a step or by a leap. And with each step, he was swinging or thrusting his swords. Stab a neck, step past the corpse, dodge a wind blade from above, and duck under a set of razor-sharp claws. Dirk wasn't fast with his movements, nor graceful. It wasn't a dance through a field of violent flowers. It was sharp, coordinated, and deliberate. Dirk wasn't one to do anything unnecessary. His plans of attack led him forward one step at a time. And he always saw five or six steps ahead. Spite was running around as well. In her cat form, she prowled between all the monsters that flew across the landscape. Nothing noticed her, or nothing simply spared her any attention. She observed. Her eyes were Dirk's eyes. He could see from both perspectives. And above all, both perspectives were that of mana vision, something that went beyond sight. Dirk often wished for his sight back. He often wished that he could just see the colors of the world without needing to comprehend some random magical concept. Mana vision made everything that much more complicated, and he didn't really like complicated. But right now, being able to see all the tiniest movements of the monsters all around him, see all their spells, the activation of their muscles, the heat roiling off their bodies. It was another world he was coming to appreciate. Because right now, fighting thousands of monsters, only mana vision could afford him the omnidirectional awareness he needed to survive this chaos. Regular vision would make things quite a bit more difficult. He had practiced fighting this way for the last few days. Practiced utilizing both his own and Spite's mana vision at the same time, and then moving according to both sets of vision. It had taken some time to bridge the disconnect, but he was a quick learner. And it wasn't like he didn't use drone feeds on Earth while he fought. This wasn't too different. Shing! Dirk's short sword plunged into the chest of a large bear as it crashed down from above him. He ducked and rolled just as it collapsed, avoiding the body that undoubtedly weighed over a thousand pounds. He was getting close. He could see the general's guards. The general he was approaching was an eagle. It hadn't taken flight yet, 
just watching him as he approached and slaughtered its armies. It had brilliant white feathers, and with Pandora's spell, Dirk could see the thousands of mind-controlling strings that extended from this bird. The guards around the bird consisted of three other birds along with two monkeys. They stood before the eagle. And when Dirk entered the clearing in front of these guards, they attacked. The three bird guards took flight, while the monkeys ran forward. The two monkeys scooped some dirt in their hands before hardening it and hurling it toward Dirk. The birds also launched some air and water blades toward him. These projectiles came from all frontal directions, blocking any routes of advance. So he improvised. Dirk instantly appeared before one of the monkeys in a black blur, his previous position being subsequently bombarded with their futile attacks. Said monkey wasn't able to react to the sword that plunged through its chest, its eyes dulling as its heart's blood sprayed out of its chest. The corpse didn't even hit the floor before Dirk moved to the second monkey. In the split second that he swung his sword though, the monkey was able to duck back and respond with another fling of some rocks. Dirk's armor hardened with a glow of golden circuits, the rocks bouncing off the metal. Still, they left some small dents which were rapidly healed. Taking those hits with a bare body wouldn't end nicely. Dirk advanced quickly, but his element of surprise was gone. The birds above launched more attacks down atop him blades slicing through the air and severing the ground beside him after he dodged. Animal levels at 47%. Spite suddenly rang with an alert as Dirk thrust toward the monkey. He frowned when the monkey had its arm cut off, the golden glow around his short sword cutting through any and all defensive measures the monkey erected. And within a few more moves utilizing Dirk's rook-class aura, it was decapitated. Come back. Dirk retreated with that command. The cat that was prowling about the battlefield simultaneously disappeared as Dirk raised his hand. The pistol appeared in his grasp, and with a sharp glow, a bullet of fire was shot at the birds above. Boom! The bullet exploded upon hitting the bird in the center, releasing a wave of fire that lightly engulfed the other two. Then, while they were momentarily blinded, he shot out three metal bullets. The birds couldn't react to those fast bullets, so they easily tore through the birds' bodies, blasting fist-sized holes in their chests. They dropped from the sky afterward. Although easily fired, those four shots cost 35% of his mana. These stronger monsters were much more expensive to kill than the basic monsters around him. Dirk wasted no time as he proceeded to face the eagle. As if snickering, the eagle suddenly spread its wings. It was going to fly high, and Dirk had a feeling it wouldn't let him shoot it like the others. With a flap, it shot into the air. Just as it ascended though, Dirk took a deep breath. He concentrated, ignoring the external attacks from the armies that were barely a second away from crashing into him. His dark mana reached out into the space around him, bending it, creating a channel. Dirk had practiced void walking a lot, and he had eventually come to the conclusion that a single one of his steps couldn't go past approximately 8 meters. 8 meters was enough to get in and out of all kinds of situations, good or bad. When fighting close combat, it afforded him amazing mobility and security. And his dark mana pool was large enough to facilitate more liberal usage instead of keeping it as a trump card. But this eagle had gone past his void walking range. He needed to go further than just 8 meters. If it got too high, he would have an impossible time killing it. It might outright flee, making his mission a failure. He couldn't have that. So he pushed himself further. He didn't try to increase the length of his step. He just took another step. Suddenly, the eagle saw Dirk's body distort. He appeared both in his original position and in the sky, only 3 meters away from it. But then, the eagle felt a chill behind it. Dirk had also appeared above it, right in its way. He had appeared in three different places. He had taken three void steps in a row. And then, he settled on the third position. The bird crashed into Dirk, who simultaneously grappled onto the feathery monster. The eagle continued to flap its wings even with the baggage, keeping them in the air. After scrambling to grab feathers, Dirk resorted to holding on to one of its legs and talons. After feeling what Dirk was doing, the eagle looked down with wide eyes. 
Screech! It yelled at him before the talons twisted and crushed down on his arm, shredding through his armor and piercing into his forearm. He didn't seem to feel the pain though as he swung his other arm, his blade slithering through its defenses. Seeing the blade about to stab into its body, the eagle pushed its neck forward. Clang! The eagle's beak blocked the sword, sounding as if it were also metal. Then, it kept pecking. Dirk swung his sword more as they rose higher and higher, clashing with the bird's beak over and over again, sending ringing noises through the battlefield. At the same time, the eagle started calling upon the wind, creating blades that wanted to slice him in two. Before that could happen though, Dirk suddenly mustered more of his anima. Obsidius pulsed as his arm jerked the eagle's leg. He pulled himself up, outright grabbing the eagle's neck with his free hand. The eagle obviously didn't like this and bit down on his arm. Snap! Dirk felt and heard his bones break, but like last time, entirely disregarded it. His other hand raised, ripping itself out of the talon that was previously grabbing it. His arm was sliced open as a result before it pointed at the eagle's head. The pistol had appeared. Boom! The metal bullet came flying out, creating a loud sound as it made contact with the bird's hard skull. With that shock to the brain, the bird faltered and started falling, passing out. For good measure, Dirk took out a short sword and cut off the bird's neck as it was passed out. Target 2 terminated. Spite spoke as Dirk stashed the hen in his pocket ring. But he was still free-falling. They had flown pretty high up. The eagle had powerful wings, and usually it was the king of the skies. It was unfortunate that Dirk had to be a pest and grab onto it. So what's the plan? Spite appeared in cat form, perching on his back as he fell to the earth. They both watched the ground quickly approach. Dirk shrugged. I don't know if void walking gets rid of my momentum, so I guess it's time to find out. Well, void walk downward if you're going to do so. If you retain momentum and teleport upward, you'll only gain more airtime and speed. True. Good luck. With that, spite disappeared. Dirk sighed before concentrating. The ground rapidly approached. It was only a few seconds before landing that Dirk cast his spell. He took two steps, appearing 8 and 16 meters downward simultaneously. That second step placed him 2 meters above the ground. And then he finished the step. But he didn't stop falling. Sure dash. Bang! A small shockwave shook the ground as he cratered. The monsters nearby all looked toward the impact site. Cough. Blood sprayed from Dirk's mouth as he coughed, his helmet retracting and letting the blood fly. Spite appeared in cat form right after, sitting atop his chest. Your left arm is shattered from the bird, your rib cage has several fractures throughout it, your spine has been misaligned, a few organs have been ruptured. I'd say a pretty good outcome, all things considered. Obsidious helped a lot, too. Yeah. Good job, Blob. Dirk choked out those words before taking a deep breath. Even breathing sent searing pains through his body, but he entirely ignored it. His nanites rapidly worked, realigning bones and sealing any internal wounds. Within mere seconds, his rib cage had been hardened and his arm bones had been realigned. Still, he waited as the monster armies slowly approached. They wondered if their enemy was dead. Some were also going insane over their lost leader, attacking the monsters around them. Dirk laid there for about twenty seconds before a monster approached with a snarl and sniffed his body. Slice! A knife suddenly appeared through its skull. It dropped as Dirk rose, pulling himself to his feet. You have about a third of your mana left and ten percent of your anima left. You think you can kill a general and make it back? We'll see. Dirk spit out some more blood before Obsidius covered his head again. He gazed at all the monsters around him. Half of them were eating each other, while the other half were watching him. Activating his muscles, he shot into the horde. Good God! The city lord couldn't help the dreary chuckle that escaped his mouth. His soldiers had reported exactly what was going on beyond the walls. He knew Pandora had finally acted. So he quickly left to watch. 
Only, he was shocked to find Pandora sitting alone on the walls, just gazing into the distance. He was even more surprised when he saw her face. In front of her I was a series of light magic circles that amplified the light coming into it and magnifying it. The city lord, being a former rank 7, had seen his fair share of advanced spells. But that spell had surprised and impressed him. It was both complex yet profound in its use. Deciding to be generous, she also cast the spell for him, allowing him to see what she saw. And it opened up another world to him. He could see the puppet strings that the monster generals had spread throughout the armies. He realized exactly how they had gone about controlling such mindless hordes. It was chilling, thinking how one monster could wield so much power over others. But he could also see a figure. One that dashed through the armies and slaughtered anything in its way. A figure that acted with such ruthless precision that even a general couldn't help but fall. Dirk. The sole combatant out there taking on the monster generals alone. He had been there to see the first general go down. And then he had watched as Dirk was pulled into the sky by the eagle. He hadn't thought he would make it. The city lord, knowing that Dirk was Riker Strider's son, had become almost desperate. As he watched Dirk fly higher and higher, he turned to Pandora and tried commanding her to do something. She was obviously a powerful light mage capable of helping him. Yet she was standing there, doing nothing. But she refused to move, telling him to just watch. And then, Dirk fell. The city lord watched as that teenager plummeted a few hundred meters. Any warrior at the rank 5 stage might barely be able to survive the fall if they could muster the feest extent of their powers. Even then, they'd be left on death's door, not to mention the threat nearby enemies posed. He watched with bulging eyes as Dirk cratered. Boom! They could hear the small explosion from the wall. And with that, the city lord had all but lost hope. They watched for half a minute, but nothing happened. He didn't get up. Not even the monsters attacked. Instead, the army started going crazy without a general. Just as the city lord was about to curse Pandora though. That figure rose, killing a monster before standing. Like a zombie rising from the dead. The city lord, though happy that Dirk survived, almost didn't want to believe someone so young could be so damn tenacious. And what was even more ridiculous was how he continued. He shot through the armies once more, fighting to the last general. Don't think you know anything about Dirk, city lord. Pandora only smirked while watching that figure slaughter his way forward. You only need to understand one thing about him. She finally looked back, her blood-red eyes staring into the city lord's soul. He can't be killed. It's that simple. Anybody can be killed. The city lord refuted, thinking that her statement was ridiculous. How could somebody not be killed? You might as well say they were a god. Pandora just rolled her eyes. No, city lord. Not everyone can be killed. Whether through fate, skill, or resilience, some people just end up surviving through all adversity. There's always a survivor. There's always that one person that makes it to the end. And Dirk has all three aforementioned qualities. He's too skilled to be killed. Too stubborn and resilient to lay down and die. As for his fate, he's too important to be killed. Just like me. Pandora gave a bright smile. The city lords I just twitched. How shameless was it to praise yourself like that? He really couldn't understand Pandora. Shaking his head, the city lord just continued watching as Dirk arrived before the last general. Chapter 125, Turtle General Dirk wasn't happy as he appeared before the final general. Although he kept moving, Dirk had continuously recovered as each minute passed by. His nanites had sealed any wounds and realigned his bones, so his combat ability rose back up to decent levels. But it all seemed for naught in front of this last general. It wasn't that the general was massive and savage. No, although it was massive, it was quite far from savage. It was a turtle. A large turtle that just sat there on the ground. The peak of its shell was about four feet tall, and each segment in its shell was thick like plates of armor. The turtle also had twelve guards around it. 
It didn't even seem like it could fight. It just sat there, while the guards waited for any prey to approach. Dirk slaughtered his way through the armies. And with the second general gone, this turtle was able to take over the rest. The entire monster population was under its control, and everything converged upon Dirk. For a while he continued to push. But when he got closer, the guards went out to meet him. All twelve guards surrounded him. The armies backed up with their arrival. But they didn't immediately attack. The twelve guards just took up positions around Dirk. Even as he shoved his short sword into the neck of a large feline, they didn't attack. Dirk dropped the corpse of the last unfortunate monster to attack him. Obsidius was drenched in blood, giving the originally black armor an eerie, dark red hue. He observed the guards around him that refused to bombard him with spells and attacks like all the others. Although they seemed like they wanted to attack, they were being held back. I'm on my way. Suddenly, he heard Pandora's voice that came through the spell on his hand. Even she had realized the odd situation. And beyond that, Dirk was reaching his limit. He had been planning to pull out. He couldn't kill another general, let alone a turtle, with how injured he was. He simply didn't have the mana or energy. But now, there was another development. Dirk spun around until he laid eyes on the turtle general. It still sat in its original position, but now, its eyes were cracked open, observing him with intelligence. The guards continued to growl at him as the turtle cast a light spell. For overlapped magic circles appeared in front of its mouth. You, strong. You, kill others. Telepathy? Dirk tilted his head as a voice appeared in his mind. It sounded like the voice of a very angry man, like a soldier yelling at something. But Dirk didn't sense hostility. Instead, he was thinking about the spell. Telepathy was an advanced light spell. It took at least a tier 5 light mage to learn and cast it, allowing them to sense messages into someone's mind. The fact that this turtle could intuitively develop the spell on its own was rather shocking. The turtle rose from the ground. After standing, it towered over Dirk like a walking fortress. Dirk couldn't imagine actually trying to break through that shell in his current state. You, me, no fight. You don't want to fight me. Why not? You, kill army. Heh. Dirk smirked. He really was killing the armies. Over a thousand had fallen in the short time he's been out here. Seemingly endless endurance allowed such fantastical feats of strength to occur. And that wasn't mentioning the several thousands he'd killed the days prior. But then, he frowned. If you don't want to fight, then you can't destroy the city. Otherwise, we can only kill you. I know destroy. I leave, army follow. As if proving his words, the armies all around suddenly stopped moving. They all halted in their tracks. Even the ones who were eating each other could only freeze in submission. It was a terrifying level of control over the remaining thousands of monsters. If the turtle coordinated all of them like this, then sieging the city wouldn't be an issue. Coming to that point though, Dirk questioned things. Why were the monsters destroying the city in the first place? What drew them here? Why did the other generals insist on constantly attacking the city, even when busy with their own civil war? Fortunately, the glint of desire in the turtle's eyes wouldn't leave Dirk guessing. I have, demand. A demand? The turtle turned its gaze to the city, as if it contained the Holy Grail. I demand mana source, inside city. I leave, army follow, mana source follow, city safe. What mana source? Dirk felt odd. Looking back at the city, he couldn't see the so-called mana source that was so attractive to the turtle. All he could see was the faint fluctuation of dark mana, but it wasn't big enough to warrant such extreme actions. What did I miss? As Dirk was wondering though, Pandora finally arrived. Her entrance was accompanied by a mist of frost crystals, making her look like some kind of ice princess. Dirk's face went neutral as he recounted everything. The turtle here wants to make a deal. A deal? It holds more intelligence than I thought. Pandora smiled at the turtle, which looked back at her warily. Dirk glanced at her. 
It says that it'll take the armies and leave, but only if it gets a mana source within the city. Whatever that mana source is, it's attractive enough for these generals to wage war over. Mana source. Oh, it must be talking about the mana crystal being used for the teleporter. Pandora quickly figured out the identity of the mana source. Teleporters, especially long-distance ones like the one being built in this city, require a powerful mana crystal as the foundation for its mana circuitry. The mana crystal needs to be at least a tier 7. They even use tier 8 crystals in the teleporter nexus of our Dark Kingdom. That crystal runs every teleporter in the capital. So I can imagine why this monster wants the crystal. After all, they evolve with those crystals. Right. Dirk nodded. They had surmised something like this while driving to the city. I've observed how these monsters operate over the past few days to confirm this theory. All magical monsters have mana crystals. It's where they draw their mana from. If a monster wants to get stronger, they eat other mana crystals. I've seen several fight over mana crystals as they tear each other apart. So it's not the meat that makes them stronger. All these monsters kill each other for the crystals. And the biggest crystal is being used inside the city. Dirk caught on. But how did they even know about the teleporter crystal? Honestly, I'm not sure. Its housing is supposed to contain it, preventing the mana from leaking. This means that something happened that exposed the crystal, basically turning it into a monster beacon, before imperfectly sealing it once more. That's why there's a faint shroud of dark mana within the city. I don't know everything about how Horizon constructs teleporters, so this is my best guess. But regardless of all that, I'm not going to give this turtle the mana crystal. I'd rather take it myself before feeding it to a monster. Pandora smiled at the turtle with those words. Naturally, the turtle understood her like it understood Dirk. It responded with a small hiss. I demand, crystal. Or, I destroy city. I don't even care about that city, let alone your demand. Shoo off, turtle. Before I brew you into food for my poor Dirk here. Pandora waved at the reptile dismissively. Of course, the turtle didn't like that. I, destroy city. With a roar, the turtle retreated into its shell. Then, all twelve guards that had been sitting around jumped at Dirk and Pandora. Despite the declaration of war and the sudden threat though, Dirk merely took a seat. I'm tired. Yes, yes, I'll take care of the rest. Cause I have to do everything around here. Dirk didn't even respond to Pandora's exhausted remark. He was more so astonished by the sheer audacity to say such a thing. The next moment, a dome of ice spikes surrounded them. Slice. Five of the monsters who jumped forward impaled themselves on those spikes. After being impaled, the spikes began to grow, engulfing the monster guards in ice. That ice was drenched in blood. And as Dirk observed, it seemed like the ice was devouring the blood, dyeing the ice red. Vampiric ice. The guards who were able to retreat or dodge all distanced themselves from Pandora. Pay attention, lazy boots. This is real magic. Pandora smiled as she brought up her hands. Dirk continued to lay around, but his mana vision was focusing on her. Above each hand, magic circles began to construct themselves. One circle, three circles, five circles. Two five-circle spells formed atop her hands. Then, she brought them together, merging them into an ten circle circuit that glowed with a deep white light. Then, like a bird set free, she let it go. The ten circle compound spell unfolded, spreading above her head like the world's most complex chandelier. Each of the circles spun with elemental activity, pulsing faster and faster. Dirk could sense earth, air, water, and light mana. She was utilizing all of her attributes. Then, the air started to chill. The temperature dropped, and the moisture in the air began to accumulate, forming little droplets of water. Those droplets froze with the freezing temperature, turning into small bits of ice. Like a conductor, Pandora guided the ice as the air was kicked up in a vortex. The ice chunks began to thin out, becoming thousands of tiny razor blades that flew with the winds of a hurricane. 
blood was drawn as the surroundings became more chaotic. It was like a storm had descended upon them, all the invisible razors flying through the air and shredding the monsters around them. Anything within 100 meters wasn't spared the brutal barrage. All the ice that looked like snow began to die red as it absorbed the blood of its victims. This seemed to fuel the storm further as it got darker and darker. By now, the turtle had retreated. Its guards could only helplessly get reduced to a blood mist. They didn't even have a chance. But the turtle felt safe. This hurricane could only shatter on its invincible shell. It even created metal fortifications around it, revealing its metal specialization. It felt safe, until the spell formation finished. Dirk was shocked as the ten-circle spell circuit, which had been pulsing this entire time, suddenly stopped with a bright flash. With that flash, the spell collapsed and dispersed into the storm. The hurricane of ice began to converge, going from a hurricane to a tornado. And then, it conglomerated in the middle. All the ice combined, forming a massive blood crystal suspended in the air above the turtle. The blood crystal rotated at unbelievable speeds, spinning faster and faster as it narrowed further into something like a needle. Then, with a satisfied sigh, Pandora brought her hands down. The blood needle dropped. Shing! The turtle shell didn't even crack as the needle punctured straight through it. The entire needle disappeared into the turtle itself. Pandora's brow raised in expectation. Boom! The momentum in the spinning needle was released not a second later. The turtle exploded from the inside out, the blood crystal composing the needle rapidly expanding without anything to keep its insane angular momentum compressed. It was nothing but a red mist that shot out of the holes in the turtle shell. If not for Dirk's numbing to all things gore, he'd find that sight awfully gut-wrenching. Pandora smiled once things settled. The turtle was far more than dead. It seemed so easy for her to kill that biological fortress. Hey! The princess glanced at Dirk, who had been rather enraptured with her display of magical prowess. Take the shell. That's good stuff, paid for exclusively by 65% of my mana. 65% of her mana. Dirk wasn't sure if that was a lot or a little. While he wasn't able to accurately gauge the turtle's strength, it was a strong tier 5 at minimum, and almost entirely devoted to defense. Along with over a thousand nearby monsters and twelve guards, she had killed that turtle with a single spell. She really was on another level. And this was his first time actually seeing her power personally. She had never cast anything other than small spells in front of him. After gazing at her for a second, Dirk pulled himself to his feet and walked over to the shell that was dripping with liquid. It disappeared into his pocket ring. Then, he walked back over to Pandora. She was facing the city walls, atop which were hundreds of soldiers. I called them since the monsters would go berserk. They'll take care of everything else. If they can't, then we'll take the teleporter's crystal and leave as they crumble. Let's just go back and eat. Dirk sighed and started walking. Pandora was with him. As for the monsters all around them, none of them were paying the duo any mind. They all rushed the city walls like their life depended on it. Dirk and Pandora used a bit of magic when any monsters got too close. Other than that, they looked to be on a nice stroll as they walked back with the hordes. Without any context, one might think they were leading these armies to siege the city. A war broke out on those walls. Not only were the monsters coming in full force, but the city was responding with everything they had. It was do or die. Only one side would stand by the end of the night. With a bit of magic, Pandora created a tunnel under the city walls for the duo to walk through. They surfaced within the city, continuing to their car. It was there that they ignored the chaos around them. Dirk was at the end of his rope, and while Pandora could fight more, she wasn't planning on doing anything. Only Dirk's peril and a monster general talking to them had gotten her to move. The days prior, soldiers would die right next to her, and she would only lift a finger to brush the attack away from herself. Well, they had defeated the generals and killed thousands of monsters by themselves. Pandora would argue they had done enough. The war raged, but nothing could be heard inside of the truck. 
Dirk had taken out a massive platter and started filling himself up with food. His injuries healed by the second as his body received mana and nutrients. Pandora sat there with him, also eating bits of food off his plates. She also occasionally observed him, staring at him randomly for several seconds at a time. Dirk noticed. He noticed everything around him through mana that gave him eyes. But he didn't care. Instead, his mind was a bit occupied. That ten-circle compound spell. Dirk had never seen anything like it. It was so exceptionally lethal and devastating. Dirk had finally seen Pandora's power. With all her mana and using the power of that hurricane, she could probably kill all the monsters currently sieging those walls outside. Dirk had to take his time as he killed monsters one or two at a time. But she could kill a thousand in a mere minute. Dirk didn't like it. She was too powerful. How many more spells did she know? Along with her stigma, just what kind of catastrophic spells could she cast? Could he keep his life should she try and kill him? It wasn't likely. This wasn't Earth. Dirk still didn't like this world of insurmountable power gaps. Perhaps his stress was shown through his eating, but Pandora began to smile as she gazed at him. I can still teach you magic, you know. Dirk momentarily slowed in his motions, before resuming. I'll take what you give me. Mm, don't be so anxious over my power. I don't need you fearing me. That's not conducive to an equal relationship. I don't fear you. Tell that to your mouth. She chuckled as Dirk inhaled more food. Suddenly, Dirk dropped a utensil. He had cleared all the plates. His gaze then settled on Pandora. Why are you being so friendly with me? Chapter 126, Conspiracy Why are you being so friendly with me? That's an out-of-the-blue question. Pandora was a bit caught off guard. Dirk's gaze remained level at her. I seem to remember pissing you off before we left. You did. After all, just how you don't appreciate being called a super soldier, I don't appreciate being called a psycho. So what's with the sudden change in attitude? Sudden? She tilted her head. Dirk, it's been a week. People's emotions can flip in an hour, let alone several days. He was silent, which caused Pandora to smile. What are you really trying to ask, Dirk? He was still quiet. But he didn't turn away as his face remained neutral. Everything Pandora did couldn't seem to sit right with Dirk. Although it didn't seem like it, he was always watching her. He was always questioning the reasons she did what she did, as if none of her actions went without motive. Pandora smiled at Dirk's silence. As if I need a reason to be nice. Are you perhaps wondering about my supposedly hidden motives? Are you wondering if I'm going to try and harm you? I don't know. You don't know. She leaned forward, her blood red gaze seemingly piercing through the cloth that covered Dirk's eyes. You don't know what I'm thinking, and that's a risk. It's an unknown variable that might bite you. It's something you can't control, because everything has to be under your control. I don't need everything under my control. Dirk rebutted, but Pandora only smirked. You're right. Dirk, both you and I seek to control everything. We just do so in very different ways. You need to be able to kill everything. You desperately wish for the security inherent to power. On Earth, it was guns and tech that gave you power. Here, it's magic. And this world has properly shown you just how powerless those with weak magic are. So, you compensate with knowledge. You want to know about every little variable just in case you need to do something about it. Dirk's face morphed into a deep frown. Why did it feel like his mind was being read? Pandora backed off as she continued, turning her piercing gaze away. I seek to control everything through influence. Blackmail, torture, seduction, bribery, manipulation, loyalty, debt. These are the tools I like to use to control others. Being a princess also helps. It allows me to do as I please with complete immunity. It was how I was able to influence the entire noble class of the Dark Kingdom to call for my own war. I thought you used the trains. She smirked a bit. 
Dirk, there are some people who want nothing more than to ensure that nobody is above them. The nobles were fine with things remaining how they were, and if there was change, then they only cared about themselves being above the others. More often than not, that meant degrading others instead of competing to rise up. So, many nobles would rather lose money than see me attain power. But with the right incentive, they all stepped behind me and did as I wanted. Pandora let out a violent snarl. I must say, it was so very satisfying to see those scum-filled dogs bow down and lick my feet. Most of the nobles actually liked my plans that would bring about unprecedented prosperity, and they cooperated nicely. But others? I've seen the worst of corruption on earth, but the power of this world unleashes a whole other level of bullshit. Fortunately, my mother had loads of dirt on everyone. I just put it to good use. That, as well as some well-timed deaths and promises of abysmal futures for their entire households. In the end, there was nothing that didn't go my way. At least until you arrived. She snickered at Dirk, whose brow raised in questioning. What did I do? What didn't you do? You were the trigger for this global catastrophe. If you hadn't come, then nothing would have changed. Your father wasn't even supposed to be chosen for the envoy group. Only the dukes had the right to be there. So tell me, why were you there? Even if your father was chosen to go, it isn't normal to bring children along. Dirk was surprised for a moment before thinking about her question. His father actually didn't want him to go, especially considering he had just gotten out of Azure's mountain only a month or so prior. There was only one reason he had even brought up the option. Dirk felt something was odd as he opened his mouth. The Emperor chose my dad for the envoy group. He also insisted that I go along. He never said why. Good God. Pandora frowned, before suddenly smiling, the corners of her mouth turning as wide as they could. He. Ha ha ha. Yes. The Emperor. Truly, you're even more amazing than my mother. Were you ready for this? How have you prepared? Why did you trigger the war now? Pandora? Dirk called out as Pandora delved into her own little world. After a bit of mumbling, her head flicked toward Dirk. Please tell me you understand what's going on. Somewhat. The Emperor knew about the covenant between the dragons and gods. Her hands flailed, as if she couldn't emphasize this enough. He had seen Eldritch Primordial attached to you. He knew that what Eldritch was doing was in violation of the covenant. So he sent you to the Dark Dragon in order to expose the violation. He directly triggered War Cataclysma. But he was also prepared. Think about this city. The city lord was given the materials to build a large-scale teleporter. But he didn't build it right away. He waited, and only started building it when he was under siege by monsters. They didn't want others to know about the teleporter. Plus, your emperor has been missing for the past couple of decades. He has? Dirk felt that was odd. Why would an emperor go missing for so long? Although Dirk had never actually seen the emperor, he didn't think he was simply absent from his empire. Pandora sighed. Have you lived under a rock? Yes, your emperor has been missing for a long time. Nobody has been able to directly confirm his existence for the past 23 years, I believe. Until he reappeared recently and it sounds like he only reappeared in order to save you from Azura's mountain. Now, he's active in his empire again, as he should be with all the chaos going on. Question is, what was he doing while he was gone? Pandora sunk back into thought, as did Dirk. The emperor sent him to trigger the war. For what reason? Dirk hadn't been conscious when the emperor came by to help him in the hospital and Spite's man of vision hadn't been good enough to save an image that Dirk could make sense of. So Dirk had still never seen the Emperor's face, except through questionable portraits of the man. There was an entire generation within the Empire that wasn't aware of their own Emperor's face. That wasn't very smart for the Empire, but then again, with enough power, what could anyone do to his reign? More concerning was just as Pandora said. What had he been doing for so long? How did he know about the Covenant? And why did he trigger the war now? 
at the very least he had to be prepared. There was no way he would just let his empire fall into ruin. In fact, the empire should be having a smooth time handling the changes compared to the other empires. Pandora seemed to have these thoughts as well, as she kept smiling and giggling to herself. How diabolical! How ambitious! Emperor Horizon, what have you planned? Are you looking for the artifacts? Do you want the sources? What about that island in the center of the world? You would rather go to war than give up that territory. Something is there. And if not for my weakness, I'd go there this instant to find out what you're hiding. Pandora's bit her thumb while gazing off into space. Dirk could practically see the tangible aura of utter focus around her. So much for their original conversation. At this point, she had gone beyond him, and he was too tired to keep thinking about conspiracies, even though he was at the center of this one. So after cleaning up any remaining cutlery and food, he made the bed and laid down, not bothering the mad woman next to him. Knock knock. Dirk woke up when he heard the first knock on the car door. Ugh. Go away. Pandora groaned as well, burying her face back into her pillow. Knock knock. Just keep quiet and maybe he'll go away. Her voice was barely audible as she continued to smother herself in the comfortable bed. But it didn't stop. Knock knock knock. Ack! Damned humans! The fuck are people banging on my precious car for at the shit crack of dawn? Have I not done enough around this godforsaken place? After a repetitive banging on the doors, she finally lost it with a barrage of cursing. Climbing up and over Dirk's body, she scrambled for the door and sent out a swift kick. Bang! Ack! Asterisk! The poor man just outside the door yelled in surprise and pain as the door smacked his face. Pandora growled at the entourage outside her vehicle. The city lord stood before her, but she didn't care. Good God, man! The hell do you want? Was killing three generals not enough to buy me a full night's rest? And I swear on all that is holy, if you ask me to help with building that teleporter, I'm taking the damned crystal and leaving. The immediate surroundings around the car went silent as everyone turned and stared at Pandora's twisted face. It was only when Dirk appeared behind her that the city lord, who was covered in armor with a bloody sword at his waist, finally spoke. No. I was just going to warn you that the monsters broke through our inner blockades. What? Are you kitty MMPH? Just as Pandora began to yell again, Dirk's hand appeared over her mouth, silencing her as he restrained her flailing body. He nodded to the city lord. Thank you for telling us. Sure. Go ahead and move this thing into the castle. After that, you can go back to sleep. No. I'll be out as soon as we park. Just guide us. With that, Dirk shut the door. The city lord just smiled before moving back out to the battlefield. After Dirk let go, Pandora let out a grunt. Ugh. What was that for? I can't believe those guys couldn't keep the monsters out even after days of preparation. I swear, without you, most armies are useless. Dirk was silent as he took his place in the driver's seat. Before he started driving though, he turned back to Pandora, staring at her for a bit. Her brow raised at his obvious gaze. Currently, she was in smooth silk clothes, fit for a princess, yet didn't do much to hide all of her goods underneath. She smiled flirtingly, until Dirk finally spoke. You're not a morning person, are you? Shut up. I'm sorry if I prefer sleeping for a full night instead of three hours like you. And if I don't get my sleep, then my genius mind doesn't operate at full capacity. Ah. Uh -huh. Just get dressed, because you're going out there with me. Dirk sighed as he started the vehicle and drove it into the castle under the guidance of a soldier. Pandora's face dropped at his words though. What? Why am I going? Because I'm not working my ass off while you sleep. And if you don't come out, I'm loading a machine gun and letting loose. No. Fine. I'll go outside. But don't expect any grand magic. Never did. He snorted as he parked inside a large hall of the castle. Then, Dirk quickly dressed and left the vehicle. Pandora wasn't far behind. 
As Dirk walked out onto one of the castle walls, Obsidius finally seemed to wake up as it slithered out from under his clothes. Realizing that he was getting ready to fight, Obsidius began bouncing on top of his head in excitement. Dirk observed the surroundings when he finally looked over the edge of the wall. It was mayhem. A carnal battlefield with mountains of corpses and pools of blood. The walls on the edge of the city had long been destroyed, a massive hole allowing wave after wave of monsters to flood through. They had broken through every defensive line that the soldiers had built, and troops were constantly falling back. It seemed hopeless, like everyone would be overrun. And the soldiers weren't the only ones beginning to panic. There were still thousands of civilians within and around the castle who were working desperately in order to help the defense effort as much as possible. But, from Dirk's view, not all was lost. The reason he thought that was because beyond the broken wall, he could see the last lines of the monster flood pushing forward. There weren't that many left. Plus, there were still plenty of soldiers. The city lord had fought for longevity, so his priority was preserving lives. His leadership had paid off. A majority of the initial army was still alive and kicking, even as they moved back. And as they moved back, their power consolidated, becoming more concentrated and effective. As they had to defend smaller amounts of land, they were able to kill more monsters. The barricades broke down slower and slower. Now, they were approaching the last few lines of defense. They could hold out long enough. The city wouldn't fall. Especially with his help. Taking in the landscape and plotting a path, Dirk tapped his connection with Obsidius. The little blob acknowledged his desire, and began to grow and spread across his body. The result was a dull set of armor. Once Dirk activated his anima though, golden circuits glowed across its body. He flexed his muscles before breaking out into a sprint, running across the wall and down toward the front lines. Pandora watched as he entered the battle unprompted. She saw a pistol appear in his hand, his stigmata that allowed for easy and specialized magic casting. The body of the pistol began to glow with runes as he took aim. And then, once he ascended one of the makeshift barricades, he fired. Three compressed fireballs shot out of his pistol, zipping over to a group of monsters and exploding in a triangular formation. This triage of fireballs compounded off of each other and roasted the dozen monsters within its range, making it even more effective than normal. And that explosion drew the attention of every soldier, even the city lord nearby. And without question, all of them lit up with excitement and valor. Dirk Strider had entered the battle. Sure enough, they all saw that dark figure dash through the hordes, brandishing his blades and drawing a bloodbath. His image of ruthless carnage served to bolster the morale of every tired soldier. They had seen this man fight for hours on end every day that he was here. And stories had already been passed around of how he killed the monster generals. Stories of Pandora's magic also went around, but nobody was fond of that cocky princess. The only thing they cared about was that one figure that dominated those hordes with endless stamina and accuracy. He was their beacon of hope. With him there, the army felt that they could win this seemingly endless battle. Chapter 127 Oddity Pandora stood in the middle of a large field. This field was located within the castle of the city itself. The castle was so massive that it had more than enough land for an internal open field. And in the center of this field was a large structure being worked on by some mages. The structure consisted of a large circular platform about 50 meters in diameter. And on the edges of this platform rose arches that curved over from one side of the platform to the other. There were two such arches, and they crossed over the center of the platform creating a cross shape. And in the middle of the arch's intersection was a large crystal orb that burst with dark mana. Mph, idiots! Pandora snorted as she gazed at that large mana crystal. The dark and light elements were opposites, and nothing could contain both elements at once. All the monster generals who wanted this orb were nothing but fools. They would only kill themselves with that orb. Only the monsters with a darkness attribute could ingest this crystal and evolve from it. But a monster general would never allow that to happen since it could threaten their power. 
so in the end, the only outcome was the monster general holding on to an expensive mana crystal for no reason. She stood before the new teleporter that was being hastily built. It was estimated that the city could fight for another day at most before either giving in or, by some miracle, winning. So the mages who were building this teleporter either had to move quickly or lose their lives trying. Of course, there was nothing for her to do. The dark element was aligned with space, so only the dark element could be used in the construction of a teleporter. She had the light element, so anything she did would only get in the way. Not that she would voluntarily offer her services anyway. The perks of being a powerful princess was that she could do as she pleased. There was no reason for her to do anything she didn't want to, unless it aligned with her goals. And nobody could tempt her with anything. She was rich beyond belief, and her personal power was nothing to scoff at. What didn't she have besides her own nation to rule? The only thing that was allowed to move her was War Cataclysma and her railways. That, as well as Dirk. If anything was an exception in her mind, it was him. But despite not planning on helping in any way, Pandora still watched the teleporter's construction. She found it interesting. She even had her stigma out, the Book of Life. In this book, pages occasionally flipped and runes jotted themselves down on the sheets. Pandora was recording the things she saw, recording the myriads of spells used to construct this teleporter, and analyzing the magical pathways strewn throughout the structure. It wasn't that Pandora didn't already know how a teleporter was built. She knew almost everything about it, except for the most high-level spells that she couldn't comprehend. No, what she found interesting was how this particular teleporter was built. It was different than most teleporters, though she couldn't quite put her finger on it. That was why she was analyzing it. In situations like these, her eyes of truth were exceptionally helpful. They revealed even more than Dirk's mana vision. Aha! Suddenly, one of the mages cried out in excitement. He quickly enchanted a circuit from the mana crystal that ran down one of the arches and connected it to the massive teleporter platform. Then, a few other mages by him came over and began working on enchanting the rest of the platform, starting from the first mage's circuit. They were getting close to completing the teleporter. There were already thousands of enchantments that riddled the teleporter platform. As a result, the platform was covered in dark glowing lines that distorted space with faint ripples. This was all a byproduct of the spatial aspect of dark mana. There was nobody more familiar with teleporters than the Dark Kingdom, the world's leader in all things dark mana. The Dark Kingdom had made teleporters far greater than any other empire, capable of transporting far more people and far faster. In fact, the only reason Pandora was able to utilize the train system was because teleporters still cost astronomical sums to operate making them impossible to use for large-scale cargo transportation. Otherwise, there would be no need for the inferior trains. Then again, Pandora already had plans for utilizing teleporter arrays as well, hopefully scaling them and making them cheap. But that would come after she dealt with this global crisis on her hands. Status Report City Lord Suddenly, a door was slammed open, revealing the City Lord who wore bloodied armor. Although he was injured to the point of dropping a few power levels, he was still capable of some fighting. Even Pandora could admit that he was a suitable leader for this place, a very competent man. A mage ran up to him, giving the report he asked for. We're making great progress. No more than half a day. Half a day? Fine. Just get it done. And make sure our reinforcements are on standby. Yes sir. The mages saluted him before getting back to work. They knew how important their work was. Complete the teleporter, or die in the siege of monsters. Then again, the mage was surprised by one thing. He's not as stressed. Hmm. He usually comes in yelling. The mages murmured as the city lord left. Of course, he didn't leave without glancing at the vampire princess. His glance was cold. He knew just how powerful Pandora was. With her help, they might actually be able to wipe out the monster hordes instead of just surviving them. Not even Dirk could operate such large-scale magic. She was perfect for a siege like this. 
But here she was, just watching as the mages worked themselves to the bone in order to complete the teleporter. She had no intention of helping in any way. Pandora understood his frustration, but she didn't care. She just smiled and waved as the city lord left before going back to watching. He had to stop himself from scoffing on his way out. After that, several more hours passed. Pandora continued to watch, and the mages got more and more excited as the teleporter neared completion. That was when the door opened once more. The mages didn't even turn. They were too focused on their work. Instead, Pandora smiled. Have a nice battle? H.M. Dirk hummed as he walked over to her, taking a seat on the grass field where she sat. He didn't speak as he activated a pocket ring and extracted some plates of food. He was naturally starving after fighting for so long, so he decided to indulge in his lunch. She gazed at him as he ate. Any particular reason you came to eat with me? Or do you just like being in my presence? I came to check on you. Make sure you weren't doing anything crazy. Dirk, I'm an elite. If I'm doing anything crazy, it's being done in the dark where nobody will find out. H.M. Dirk hummed as she smirked, just continuing to eat. His lunch lasted close to two hours, and during that time his body healed any and all injuries from the battle. You know what's funny? Just as Dirk finished, Pandora drew his attention. A teleporter, despite utilizing a tier 7 mana crystal, only requires a tier 6 mage to construct it. Of course, there are specific parts of the teleporter like the housing for the crystal itself that must be constructed by a tier 7. But besides that, a tier 6 can build the rest. She pointed to one of the mages currently building the teleporter. He stood out as he was dressed in nicer robes, carrying a book heavy with mana, and was giving out orders to the rest of the mages. That's a genuine tier 6 mage right there, and he's in here building the teleporter, not outside fighting. He could do more than me in the battle, but he's here. Makes you wonder how things would go if the city lord simply sent him out to fight instead of playing around in here. Or perhaps he's one of the mages that was specifically assigned to building this secret teleporter, and he doesn't wish to fight, forcing the city lord to break his back out there to keep the city alive. Dirk was silent as he gazed at the mage she was talking about. Dirk could in fact sense the deep mana within him, fluctuating wildly with the dark element. He was a powerful mage, and there was no doubt he had powerful spells in his arsenal. Dirk wasn't sure what to say though. On one hand, the city lord was making a hypocritical decision, keeping the mage in here. On the other hand, if the mage was refusing the fight so he could take it easy building the teleporter, and the city lord couldn't do anything about it since he was now weak. Either way, the situation was made worse by the mage being in here and not out on the battlefield. It made Dirk want to go back out there and continue fighting. The more he did, the fewer people died. He found reward in these battles he fought by seeing how few people died to the monsters. Just as he was about to stand though, Pandora grabbed his arm. Stick around, Dirk, my ruthless consort. Let's watch as this teleporter is completed. Perhaps we might learn something interesting. Dirk's eyebrow raised at her odd insistence. But seeing her ruby red eyes that beckon him to stay, he decided to play along and rest for a bit more. He sat back down beside her, shifting away as she got nice and close. In the end, she was holding his arm as if they were a couple on a picnic. After a few minutes, her face got close to his ear. Are you seeing what they're doing with the teleporter? I can see the mana, yes. H.M., but I guess you don't know how a teleporter works, huh? Here, I want you to focus on the runic circuits they lay down. This is all spatial in nature, so you should have no trouble picking up some inspiration from this high-level application. I even heard that you were able to mimic my mother's fancy little spatial shift spell at the banquet. Dirk thought back to the advent of the Dark Dragon, the banquet that was held prior, when dancers had come up on stage and performed an odd sequence of movements. Their bodies moved dark mana, tracing out special runes and spell formations. Dirk had been curious and started mimicking what they traced. Pandora smiled. Believe it or not, you succeeded in recreating that spell. So instead of appearing on stage in front of everyone, 
my mother utilized your spell and appeared behind you. It was a special spell that allows both parties to reach out and connect to each other, not unlike a teleporter. The part that my mother gave you was the second half of the spell. I believe you took inspiration from that in making your odd void walking spell, correct? I did. Dirk confirmed her guess. In an attempt to void walk, he had pulled inspiration from all sorts of things. The spell that the Queen of the Dark Kingdom used to appear in the banquet was one major source of inspiration. When void walking, Dirk made contact with two points in space, overlapping them and making himself appear in both spots at once. The spell the queen used worked in a similar way, by connecting two points of space to each other through a magical handshake, and then bridging the gap. If he were to openly cast the spell, then one would be able to see runic formations similar to the ones he was given by the queen. Pandora pointed at the mana crystal that sat at the top of the teleporter, housed in a complex runic nexus that had been pre-built in another place. That housing for the crystal is the portion that connects the two teleporters. Everything else is auxiliary. The platform allows a group of people to be isolated in a spatial bubble and teleported. But that's the easy part. Connecting two teleporters across thousands of miles is the difficult part. And not just connecting them, but making sure the spatial channel is stable. If it wasn't, then the group being teleported would either be torn apart by spatial waves or ejected at some random point along their path, usually not in a desirable position. Anyway, start observing and learning what you can. As soon as enchantments like these are completed, they're hidden and encrypted so that nobody can easily observe them like right now. Of course, I've found something odd with this teleporter, otherwise I wouldn't be watching this boring process. Maybe you can help me find out what it is. You see dark mana better than I do. You see dark mana? Dirk asked with sudden curiosity. Didn't she have the light attribute? She shouldn't be able to see dark mana. But she still nodded. Of course. It's the opposite of light mana, and both are in everything. Anything that doesn't have light mana has dark mana. So I can make out dark mana and their runic formations. You told me about your black and white mana vision. I would assume you use the same logic. I think I just look at dark mana and the lack of it, not necessarily light mana. Well, a lack of dark mana means that light mana is there. And neither can be mixed in any amount since they're opposites, so if your vision utilizes dark mana, then keep that in mind. Interesting. Dirk's head tilted as he thought about that. His dark mana vision had been looking at dark mana and creating various shades of darkness based on the abundance or lack of it. He didn't think he should be able to see light mana, so he hadn't thought about it. But if what Pandora said was correct, then not only should he be able to see light mana, but he's been looking at dark mana all wrong. There was no such things as shades or degrees of dark mana, only the presence of it or the presence of light mana. Suddenly, something clicked in his mind. Along with this new knowledge, his vision began to change. The images of black and white began to warp before sharpening. At first it was blurry, but Dirk knew that light mana couldn't mix with dark mana, so he began to pick out the different types and separate them. Then, like a camera lens adjusting to find the best focus, everything became clear. Dirk started to smile as his black and white vision became almost perfect. He could see the teleporter in its sharp edges and smooth curves. He could see the grass and its stems and weeds. He could see the movements of all the mages as they worked and made their clothes flutter and wrinkle. Finally, he felt like he could see clearly once more, and things didn't become worse with distance. Now, Dirk was aware of not just dark mana, but the light mana all around him. And all this light mana was so vivid in his vision, almost more so than the darkness. This light mana seemed to reach out to him, making his long-distance sight almost telescopic. Dirk spent almost two hours focusing on his vision, clearing up any inaccuracies and overlapping it with his other elements. With fire to see the heat and vitality of people's bodies, lightning to see the movement of energy through bodies, earth to see the material of their bodies, and metal to see the textures and rigidity of those materials. Everything came together, granting Dirk unprecedented clarity. Before, his elements weren't able to cooperate, one thing looking different from another. 
it was like having several different eyes, all of them seeing different things. But now, they all came together. They not only saw the same things, but showed different layers of the object he saw. They all gave him different insights that he could use to track movements and anticipate. It was almost like having eyes again. Dirk became lost in this new world of vision. After a while though, the Tier 6 mage began to murmur with a wide smile on his face. That's when Dirk saw it. The dark mana crystal on the teleporter began to activate, infusing the structure with spatial power. At the same time, a net of dark mana spread out from the crystal, as if waiting for a fly to catch. If that was it, Dirk wouldn't be so surprised. But then, he saw a different, foreign channel of dark mana appear nearby the teleporter. That foreign channel came seeking this particular teleporter. It was the fly, and it was seeking out a net to catch it. Pandora seemed to see it too. But unlike Dirk's merely curious gaze, she was shocked. No way. We barely have that tech. How did the Horizon Empire manage to develop it? Unless we have a mole. Pandora frowned, finally figuring out the oddity with this teleporter, an oddity she could only recognize through that connection method. Two teleporters connected through a handshake. Both of them were the transmitter and receiver, creating a two-way exclusive channel. But for one teleporter to be a dedicated transmitter, and one to be a dedicated receiver, required sophisticated magical knowledge that the Dark Kingdom only recently invented. With that tech, you could have a single teleporter connect to dozens of others. Currently, the best teleporters that capital cities were outfitted with were a nexus comprised of several teleporters, all of them connected to other cities. One teleporter could only connect to one other teleporter in an exclusive pair. And the nexus was created when a single mana crystal augmented several other crystals, making them more powerful. But the previous limiter of exclusivity remained unchanged. But if one teleporter could connect to dozens of others, it would make teleporters far cheaper and allow them to be far more widespread. This was technology that only the Dark Kingdom had developed, and it was a national secret that only Pandora and other royalty could know about. Even then, only Pandora had thought about using it after installing her railways. The tech was too new, and not yet completely stable. To think it had appeared in the Horizon Empire. Pandora watched this technology in action. She watched as a teleporter from the capital city connected to the teleporter in front of her, creating a complex spatial channel. But it wouldn't form instantly. Even as everything operated, the Tier 6 mage was casting spells and monitoring the enchantments. After a while, things settled down, with the connection process gradually forming on its own. This was normal for a teleporter then was only just created. So what was odd? Dirk eventually asked, causing Pandora to sigh. You guys shouldn't have the technology necessary to create this kind of teleporter. It seems like I'll need to do a one-over on our research and development teams when I get back. I refuse to believe your empire is on par with us who specialize in dark magic. Okay. Well, I'm going to go out and fight then. I've rested enough. Sure, sure. Do be careful, my dear. I'm not your dear. Dirk shook his head on his way out, making Pandora smile. She then refocused back on the teleporter, wondering who would be set once the connection was made. Chapter 128, Marshall The Capital City Horizon of the Horizon Empire There was no busier city than this. Both citizens and military alike were constantly moving, hastily trying to complete some sort of task or work. There were extremely few people who weren't anxious or busy. At the northern sector of the city was a military installation, this also being the largest military compound in the empire. With a fortress only smaller than the emperor's castle, there were tens of thousands of troops and high-ranking military officials who either lived here or worked here. It was the busiest part of the city. Teleporters constantly flashed, none of them ever being idle for more than a few minutes. Thousands of people were moved through these teleporters every single day. The expenditures to maintain this kind of mass transportation were usually astronomical, but nobody seemed to think that here. Instead, these teleporters were being treated as wagons, regular troops being teleported by the hundred. 
Nowhere else on the planet could a teleporter be used so freely. This fact was a frequently discussed topic, even over a month after the dawn of war cataclysma. In one such chamber of this military installation, there was a marshal, a tier six commander of the Empire's military. He was draped in vivid red robes, embroidered with a deep gold and carrying a special crest only marshals could receive directly from the Emperor himself. His face was hardened, and his young age was partially masked by the sharp beard that was expertly tamed. Even his hair was slicked back, displaying masculine discipline. This man hovered over a table, and he wasn't the only one. There were others who frequented this particular room, analyzing and checking the magical displays that projected maps of places all over the empire. It was a war room, and not the only one of its kind. Suddenly, a door flew open, but nobody noticed over the chatter. A skinnier man with the rank of knight captain, equivalent to a tier four, took large strides toward the sharp man. Marshal Strider. The teleporter at the city of Kellerin has established a connection. Your troops are on standby to enter. The knight captain stood behind Marshal Strider, gazing at the massive sword hung on his back. The only thing larger than this five-foot-long greatsword was the nearly seven-foot-tall marshal. He had grown even taller than his father. Marshal Strider straightened his back, turning toward the knight captain, yet keeping his gaze above his head. Very well. We depart now. Every second is precious for those on the other side. Yes, sir. The night captain saluted before rushing out. Marshal Strider followed with steady steps, his gaze sharp, yet filled with anticipation. About time we have a reunion, little brother. Pandora watched as the teleporter flashed and distorted. Of course, this didn't make her happy. She sighed as she watched this experimental technology take action. In her mind, she was thinking about how she needed to accelerate her plans more than they already have been. At the same time, the distortion of the teleporter revealed figures. There were easily a hundred of them. Once they stepped out, Pandora could see their armor and weapons at the ready. The first man to step out was the leader of the group. Marshal Strider. Oh? Pandora's brow raised as the Tier Six mage in charge of the teleporter's construction rushed over to this marshal. He turned his head and gazed at the mage. What's the situation? They're all outside fighting, even the city lord. The monsters are breaking through our barricades as we speak. We're on our last legs. Understood. Lead us out. Of course. Please save our city. The mage was fervent in his request, showing genuine concern and fear towards the oncoming monster hordes outside. Even as he hastily guided the marshal, he was throwing out words of horror while describing the many days and weeks of battle, as if he'd been there. Pandora was scoffing while watching this, disgusted with the mage. Well, I guess I know why he's in here and not battling. Filthy coward. She stood from the ground while doing nothing to hide her disgust. Then, she looked at the marshal. The marshal similarly turned his head toward her, and the two made eye contact. For a moment, the marshal was stunned, shocked by this random girl's abnormal beauty and silent pressure. But he momentarily composed himself, taking in Pandora's features before continuing to follow the mage. Pandora watched as the marshal's troops followed, a few captains staying behind to guide the continuous stream of reinforcements out of the teleporter. There were thousands of soldiers, more than enough to match the current army here at the city. And they were all high quality, unlike a large portion of the city's army that was composed of prior citizens. She left through another exit, heading out toward the battlefield. Marshal Strider After rushing out of the gates of the castle, Marshal Strider saw the city lord running toward him. He was bloodied and exhausted, yet forced himself to stand tall. Marshal Strider had heard the situation and knew that the city lord had been horribly crippled. So when he saw the city lord who had obviously been fighting, he gave him the same respect as he would a superior. Grand Marshal Baron. Please, Marshal Strider, I'm just a city lord here. The city lord put out his hand, and Marshal Strider clasped it in greeting. Then, the city lord frowned. Unfortunately, this is no time for greetings. 
our troops are barely holding our final defensive line. Please bring your soldiers to reinforce. Of course. Are there any monster generals? No. None. I see. Knight Commander Hassan. Marshal Strider let out a deafening bellow. At his call, a burly man wielding a long spear hurried to his side. Marshal. Commander, lead our troops to reinforce. Let's relieve this ruined city and drive back these mindless beasts. Yes, sir. Knight Captains. Form up. Letting out a few commands, the Knight Commander summoned a legion of knights to his back. All of them were bloodthirsty and primed for battle. Fighting mindless monsters was different from fighting people. When fighting wars against other empires, there would always be the weight of taking the lives of other people. Very few people truly wanted to take the lives of others, or risk their lives fighting others. But monsters? That was a hobby of many soldiers, in a well paid profession. In some places it was a sport. Dungeon diving was the most popular job for those with the power. So these knights, when faced with hordes of monsters, charged with no reservations. There was nothing to cloud their mind except the joy of cleaving beasts in two. Plus, the chances of dying against monsters was much lower than if they were to fight other people. With their gear and training, they seemed to fear nothing. After forming up, the knights grasped their swords, spears, and bows. Mana was kicked up by the mages in the back line, and the weight of anima began to surround those in the front. The marshal, ahead of even the knight commander, raised his sword. Everyone watched as a spark ignited on the tip of the blade, and then, an inferno surrounded the great sword. It blazed with such heat that even those from afar could feel its warmth. It was a beacon of power in the chaos of battle. The marshal faced the defensive line. Charge! Ah! The knights roared as they sprinted forward, rapidly overcoming the defensive line and pushing forward. They clashed with the monsters who were about to overwhelm the barricades. Splat! Blood began to fly as the knights drove their weapons forward. Hundreds and thousands of knights flooded toward the monsters, looking like no less of a horde themselves. And within moments, the tide of battle turned. The knights pushed the monsters back, leaving the corpses of monsters behind. Mages from the back also launched spells that exploded in front of the knights. Even the marshal was throwing himself into the chaos, finding a massive pile of monsters in front of even the mage's bombardment and tearing them to shreds. His great sword covered in flames released an inferno all around him. By now, night had already fallen, so he was a beacon of light in the darkness. A single wave of the blade cleaved five and half and set a dozen more on fire. The marshal seemed like a fire elemental, commanding scorching waves to turn his enemies into ash. And those who could actually see his sword skills were left in awe. The marshal didn't just wield brute strength. He moved his sword with valiance, and his flames seemed to mimic his spirit. He was a much needed powerhouse on this battlefield. But as he fought, he couldn't help but realize that there was someone else out there. The marshal swung his sword, releasing a wave of flame that engulfed a few dozen monsters in front of him. Then, he glanced to the side. Not far away, there was a dark figure that blended in with the night. This figure dashed around silently, but every movement drew the blood and screams of the monsters he killed. Marshal Strider, upon focusing more, couldn't help but gawk at the uncanny agility and reflexes of this figure. The short swords in his hands moved with such ruthless efficiency, stabbing or slicing the vitals of every monster he came across. When he encountered a stronger monster, the marshal could see golden lines flash across parts of his body. Whenever that happened, the strong monster would come out with a horribly lethal wound, dropping to the floor only moments later. Then there was the darkness that the marshal sensed. That figure would occasionally appear in two or three spots simultaneously, the shroud of dark mana engulfing his person. It resembled void walking, but not quite. Still, this skill afforded that figure the ability to remain untouched. No monster could escape, and none could pin him down. That figure wasn't explosively powerful, but he was the most lethal the marshal had ever seen. His use of magic and weapons was so fluid and skilled. 
it was a level of combat ability the marshal had only partially experienced from sparring with people at a higher level than himself. As for the faint suspicion in his mind, he disregarded it for a while. The marshal and that dark figure continued to fight. The marshal was able to kill far more at a time, but the figure was constant. He continued to kill at an almost fixed rate, never deviating and eternally building his kill count. He didn't seem like he could even get tired. It was strangely robotic. This battling lasted only a few hours. With the marshal scorching fields of enemies, and his thousands of fresh knights driving back and slaughtering the monsters, the dwindling hordes couldn't hold out for long. Finally, it was when the knights had advanced to where the marshal was fighting that he backed off. Flame still flickered around his sword as he watched his knights push back with bloodlust that only built up over hours of fighting. That dark figure also stopped, dropping the corpse of a bird that had tried to ambush him from above. Its neck had been wrung like a wet towel. The figure turned his head, facing the marshal that was observing him. Finally, the marshal could see exactly what this figure was wearing. Sleek armor with golden circuits covering his entire body, like some sort of flexible metal. The armor was basically featureless. That in itself was a bit intimidating, giving off an inhuman feeling. After some time of staring at each other, the faceless figure tilted his head. Ethan? Dirk? Hearing his name called, the marshal finally confirmed his guess. There weren't many people who would call him by his first name so casually. The two brothers continued to stare at each other for another few seconds before they were interrupted. How happy! A family reunion. There was an enthusiastic clap, and the two turned their heads. Pandora stood nearby amidst a small pile of corpses, looking between the brothers that couldn't be more different. She smiled at Dirk. Those knights have everything taken care of. We can finally rest. As if you did anything. I seem to recall killing a giant turtle. Anyway, you can speak with your brother as you eat. With that, Pandora turned and walked. The two brothers looked back at each other. Ethan scratched his beard in confusion. Who is that? I'm sure she'll be more than happy to explain. Dirk sighed and followed Pandora. Ethan fell in behind them, even more confused at the whole situation. The vampire princess? Ethan was baffled as he stuck a slice of meat into his mouth. Dirk, who disregarded Obsidius bouncing around his plate of food, also kept eating. Ethan, Dirk, Pandora, and the city lord were all eating in this small room that had been repurposed with a table and chairs for eating dinner. Outside, the battle was finishing up, just about every monster in the vicinity having been wiped out. Ethan wasn't sure what to say as he momentarily made eye contact with Pandora's blood pearl eyes. This was the last person he expected to be beside Dirk. Literally anybody else would have made more sense. But instead, Dirk had one of the world's highest members of royalty eating food off his plate. The city lord understood Ethan's confusion. He too had been baffled on several occasions as he witnessed the antics between Dirk and Pandora. The situation with a grumpy Pandora in the morning had been particularly shocking experience. He still couldn't reconcile that warped image with the graceful princess sitting in front of him. Eventually, Ethan shook his head and gazed at Dirk. Both brothers hadn't seen each other in many years. Ethan had left the academy before Dirk entered, and afterward he entered the military. There was no opportunity for them to see each other. It was the same with the other siblings like Viola and Rita. They were almost complete strangers both of them changing into completely different people. They had only been children the last time they saw each other. Still, Ethan was more surprised over Dirk's changes than his own. But then again, he also happened to know about Dirk's kidnapping and brutal time at Azura's Mountain. He guessed that the only possible outcome was for Dirk to become a killing machine, having been trained into an assassin and all. Nonetheless, Ethan was glad that they had finally been able to meet again. It wasn't in the best of circumstances, but that didn't matter to either of them. So Dirk, what are your plans after this? In fact, why don't you tell me just how you got yourself in the middle of a monster siege? Hmm. Dirk hummed before explaining the situation. Of course, 
he left out certain key details like their goals and traveling to the Dwarven Haven, but other than that, he told Ethan mostly everything. It ultimately boiled down to him following Pandora and keeping an eye on her. As for their unique relationship, neither Dirk nor the princess were able to explain it to them. There were only two people in this world who knew about their situation, and they were their mothers. After a while, Ethan had a good enough picture. So he knew enough to know that Dirk wouldn't be coming back to the capital with him. But, he still mentioned something that piqued both their interests. After securing this city, I've got a mission to check out the major dungeon nearby. You should join me. Chapter 129, Execution Check the dungeon? Only major dungeons exist, and no offense, but I don't believe a tier 6 carries enough insurance to traverse that place with baggage. Pandora chimed in with concern. Dirk was thinking the same thing. Ever since the advent of the Dark Dragon, all minor dungeons disappeared, and all major dungeons began spewing out monsters. The accepted theory was that the major dungeons consumed the minor dungeons and then expelled those monsters making the major dungeons extremely difficult to approach with hordes surrounding them. Regardless of that though, the major dungeons were still major dungeons. The minimum strength of a monster within those dungeons was tier 3, while the strongest was tier 7. Those dungeons were the most dangerous places in the world, and wasn't a place even Dirk and Pandora could traverse lightly. Not even Ethan Strider, a marshal of the Horizon Empire and a tier 6 fire swordsman, could guarantee his life in that dungeon, let alone the baggage that was Dirk and Pandora. Ethan only nodded at their worries. That's true. I've only been in a major dungeon a few times, and each time involved at least one life or death battle. Even now I wouldn't wish to go alone, especially on a scouting mission. But there's someone who's going to be joining us. A Grand Marshal. A Tier 7? If that were the case, then I wouldn't mind. But for what reason do you need to scout the dungeons anyway? Without defeating the king, there aren't any special rewards. Unless you're looking for particular monster types for their resources. Hmm. Ethan hummed, gazing at Pandora for a while as if debating whether or not to answer. This made her smile brightly, as she did whenever she broached a conspiracy. This must be a special order from your emperor, especially if he's sending your grand marshals. I haven't attained much intelligence myself of the major dungeons, but it seems as if the expulsion of the monster hordes isn't the only change that's taken place in this world. On top of the unnatural increase in capable mages amongst the common people, I guess I need to send some people out to do reconnaissance. Hmm, I think I need to contact someone later today. Ethan began to frown oddly as if Pandora just learned something she shouldn't have. Dirk just sighed though. Pandora was really good at jumping to conclusions, and each time it seemed to be on the dot. Then again, her mind was all over the place. She wouldn't have an issue believing the most outrageous developments. Ethan let out a slightly frustrated breath. If you don't want to come, then please rest here. No no, I would love to take up your offer. It'll be a good learning experience, as I've only been in a major dungeon once. What about you, Dirk? Have you ever been in a major dungeon? Take a wild guess. That's a no then. She chuckled at Dirk's curt response. Then we shall go. Please notify us when your Grand Marshal arrives. I'm sure such a person doesn't wait for anyone, so we'll be rested and ready when the time comes. Sure. Ethan resigned himself and just agreed. Not long after, the time came to retire. With the reinforcements, the city was finally able to rest easy for the first time in many weeks. Marshal Strider's captains reported the situation all night, getting an idea of what had happened. In the end, they found out that approximately 82% of the city's initial population had died. The remainders were troops and able citizens who had held out day after day nothing remained of the previously prosperous city. It was a nightmare. The only thing that would have been worse was utter obliteration. Ethan received these reports and couldn't help but become a bit sorrowful. In his mind, he compared it to the other cities that had been saved. Among those that had survived sieges by monsters, this was by far the worst. Some were able to stave off the monsters, 
building a teleporter before monster generals had grown and launched catastrophic attacks. Other cities were able to wipe out the monster hordes. The city of Kelleran though, for how significant and massive of a city it was, experienced the worst of the monster hordes. Located near a major dungeon and accidentally acting as a beacon with the Tier 7 mana crystal, they were now by far the most devastated city, especially when it came to death count. It couldn't even be considered a city any longer. The next day, Ethan saluted the teleporter. The Grand Marshal had come. Welcome, Grand Marshal Vincent. Marshal Strider. Grand Marshal Vincent, a woman garbed in fitted clothes that seemed to be made from the leather of a dragon, and adorned with a frightening set of large knives, nodded to Ethan as she left the teleporter. A Grand Marshal was a tier or rank 7, and in the Horizon Empire, tier 7s were afforded a certain level of nobility, especially if they were loyal and had contributed significantly to the Empire. Grand Marshal Vincent, being a Grand Marshal of the Empire's military, was naturally a Marquis as well. Ethan was also familiar with this woman, as was his father Riker. It was why Vincent smiled at Ethan, showing familiarity instead of acting strict like what normal rank differences warranted. I've received the reports. Let's walk as we talk. Vincent motioned with a graceful turn, and Ethan followed her out of the castle. They entered the ruined city, and saw many soldiers and civilians running around with various tasks. Compared to the previous days though, they were much less busy. Most were resting or getting treated inside the castle. Vincent saw all of this, and remembered the reports she had read the previous night. I've only experienced devastation like this twice, and both times were during the bloody war around half a century ago. To think I'd have to see it again. Marshal Strider, do you know how many cities have been annihilated so far since the dawn of war cataclysma? Ethan sifted through his memories at her question, eventually shaking his head. I don't recall ever hearing about an annihilated city. That's because there has yet to be one. Through the Emperor's foresight and our advances in teleporter technology, we were able to create a network of teleporters across the entire empire and transport troops wherever they were needed. This is a perfect example of teleporters saving a city. It's a shame that it had only been constructed now. Otherwise, we could have saved the city before it reached this level of ruin. Yeah. Ethan closed his eyes and nodded. Hundreds of thousands of people had been eaten alive in this city. Even now, there were mountains of bodies and corpses strewn throughout the ruins. Both human and monster. It was a gruesome sight. One could only imagine the atrocities that had been experienced here. The two stared out at the city for a while. Eventually, they were approached by the city lord. Vincent sighed as she gazed at the city lord. Marquis Baron. What you did for this city won't be forgotten or unrewarded. I'm only sorry that your reward can't be repairing your body and reclaiming your previous glory. Grand Marshal Vincent, I'm only happy that we were able to survive at all. I won't say that I'm not devastated, but this also won't stop me. I have plans to work in the capital after this. Anything to help in the war effort. You're a good man, Baron. Vincent closed her eyes for a moment before opening them with sharpness. Now, I have business with the major dungeon here, but there's one thing I must do first. Where's the dark mage who was assigned to the teleporter? The city lord froze up at the question. Not because he was surprised, but because of the twisted frown and rage that suddenly spewed from Vincent's body. He's currently in a room of the castle. Good. Marshal Strider. Awaiting orders. Ethan automatically straightened up as Vincent spoke with hate in her voice. The Dark Mage is now marked for execution for treason against the Empire and the mass murder of everyone who died in this city. Retrieve the pig immediately and bring him here so he can be slaughtered. I understand. Ethan rushed off without question as Vincent turned to stare into the distance. She gazed at all the bodies monster and human, and imagined the weeks of endless battle and torment. All the sorrow of losing comrades. The terror of everyone who was eaten by the invading monsters. The empty eyes of those who survived. Her blood boiled, knowing something the others would discover soon enough. 
Pandora tilted her head as she looked at the twisted face of the Grand Marshal. Dirk was beside her, also focused on this person of unchallengeable might. She's really mad. I wonder why. She called for the Dark Mage, that coward who should have been fighting. Maybe he did something? Maybe. The two shrugged, then approached the Grand Marshal. The Grand Marshal's face was passive as she turned her attention to them. Even then though, her gaze was focused on Pandora. Vampire Princess. Grand Marshal Revela Vincent, of the Vincent family. The only one after her father to rise to the level of a Marquis. It's a pleasure. Pandora nodded with a bright smile, garnering no response from the Grand Marshal. The Grand Marshal stared at Pandora for a second more before looking at Dirk. This time, her brow raised in what seemed like approval. I've never seen someone as young as you with such a concealed aura. I can't read any of your intentions. It's a frightening level of control. Impressive, Dirk Strider. Dirk was silent as his gaze rested on the Grand Marshal. Yet another person he couldn't win against. He could already see it. Her body was abnormally strong. His intuition could sense the danger she posed. And interestingly, there wasn't an ounce of cultivated mana in her body. Instead, her body was shrouded with a thick layer of fog, anima that Dirk couldn't see through. As Dirk was silent and evaluating the woman in front of him, the city lord took a spot by her side. Grand Marshal, Dirk Strider was actually the only reason we survived so long. He alone was able to fend off thousands of monsters, helping our entire army last several more days. He also assassinated the monster generals before they could grow. If not for him, we would have fallen before the teleporter could be built. Is that so? The Grand Marshal smiled a bit. If that's the case, then a reward is in order. However, the only rewards we can currently give are titles of nobility equal to your power or equivalent positions in the military. Dirk Strider, if your skills are anything like your mother's, then I can make you a knight commander right now, which is a position only tier 5s can attain. How about it? Would you like to join your brother in the Empire's military? Oh? Pandora smiled a bit wider hearing the offer, nudging Dirk with a smirk. An offer to become a soldier. They've seen your skills, Dirk. You'll become a renowned assassin, the best at killing. Sent all over the Empire to remove the threats to their peace and safety. You'll be cultivated and developed, sent on mission after mission, executing target after target. Shut up, now. Hmm. Pandora hummed with her same smile as Dirk snapped. On his face was a frown, confusing the Grand Marshal. More than that though, the Grand Marshal was shocked at Dirk's unrestrained attitude with the Vampire Princess. Though, the fact that such a high-profile girl was here at all was a mystery in itself. Letting out a breath, Dirk gave the answer he instantly decided on. Sorry, Grand Marshal Vincent. I'm not interested in joining the military. Really? Might I ask why? She asked, but Pandora chimed in Dirk's stead. Unfortunately, Grand Marshal, that's a super big secret that we can't tell you about. After all, it involves the fate of the world. And Dirk here is my partner who's here to help me along through these arduous times. Pandora linked with Dirk's arm, earning her a hand that pushed her face away. The Grand Marshal watched weirdly as Dirk kept pushing the clingy Pandora. What the hell was their relationship? She had heard about what happened at the Dark Kingdom, with Dirk's shocking relationship with Pandora being the focal point. Even now she could see the sign of their blood pact on his neck. It was the royal seal of the Dark Kingdom, and a sign that stated Dirk was equal to the princess herself. It was light by no means. The only reason his existence hasn't created waves of controversy in the upper echelons of the Empire was because not many knew about it. She happened to be one because of her own relationships with certain dukes and her station in the military. Grand Marshal. Suddenly, there was a shout. Ethan appeared, and behind him were two soldiers who restrained the Dark Mage. The Dark Mage was baffled, his face full of fear and desperation. Grand Marshal. I'm innocent. My only job was to construct the teleporter. I don't understand what's going on. 
Pig. The Grand Marshal snarled as she laid eyes on the Dark Mage. She refused to even call him by his name. City Lord. Yes? The City Lord turned to her, expecting answers. Her furious gaze remained on the mage. I noticed as soon as I teleported here. The Tier 7 Dark Mana Crystal was given to you in its housing, and in the housing is an alarm that indicates when it has been tampered with. This alarm reached out to my Grand Marshal Seal upon arrival. It told me that someone of Tier 6 power attempted to remove the crystal, but failed. And there is only one person in this place, who is a Dark Mage, in Tier 6. The Grand Marshal drew one of her blades, a long knife that was attached to a chain. She pointed the knife at the mage's face, her horrifyingly dense aura not allowing the mage to speak. The city lord was likewise mortified, but not because of her aura. It was tampered with approximately three weeks ago. And I already know exactly what happened. This filth tried to take the crystal and escape. But in the process, he only damaged the housing for the crystal. The result was several more weeks of work to repair his damage and get the teleporter functioning. Even now though, it barely works. I noticed unnatural turbulence when coming here. We will have to request a tier 7 dark mage to fix his damage. Thankfully though he was at least able to get reinforcements here. Otherwise, he alone would have been responsible for this city's annihilation. Oh my! Pandora was surprised, looking at the dark mage with a raised brow. She didn't seem angry about it though, merely looking at it like a drama. Dirk, on the other hand, wasn't as nonchalant. As the Grand Marshal spoke, something within him, tightened. He was no stranger to war, but the battles he fought were special. He had never experienced something like this, where someone's greed and cowardice resulted in the downfall of so many people. Or at the least, he had never been made aware of it. Even in a time of battle, this mage tried to escape with the city's only hope. If he had just constructed the teleporter like normal, so many people would have survived. It was the most unthinkable thing, yet Dirk was seeing such a person in front of him. This weak, cowardly, disgusting man, had nearly destroyed a city. It made Dirk think of two things. One, such weakness was revolting. And two, such a person doesn't deserve to live. For a moment, he was about to lunge forward and end the pig's life himself. But before he could, the Grand Marshal slowly pushed her blade into the mage's mouth. She twisted it around, ignoring the man's gurgles and screams. You killed all those who died here. Not the monsters. You. Every single man, woman, and child who died is blood on your hands. I don't know why you tampered with the crystal. But I don't care. The damage that only you could have caused is the reason why they're dead. So it doesn't matter whether it was your stupidity, your greed, or your fear that made you do what you did. You will pay for your actions with your life. The Grand Marshal pulled back her knife, before pushing it toward the man's stomach. Before she could though. Dirk sensed a burst of dark mana, and the mage moved across space. Zip! Shit! The Grand Marshal cursed, her head turning toward the distance. The mage struggled in the restraints that he had been bound with by Ethan. The Grand Marshal was just about to run over there, but someone beat her to it. She saw Dirk Void walk to the mage. He appeared right beside him, and with lightning quick movements, he sliced the tendons in the mage's arms and legs. Dirk didn't have any visible eyes, but his gaze made the mage shiver. Dirk's aura felt abnormal, eerie. It was rage, but it was horrifyingly quiet. With a wave of his hand, Dirk summoned four metal arrows and let them drop. They nailed each of the mage's limbs down, causing him to scream, though he couldn't move around or struggle much. The Grand Marshal, who was about to jump over there, slowly rose from her stance, her cold eyes gazing at the mage and Dirk. Strider. She called, and Dirk's head turned. For a moment, she too felt that eerie gaze, but she ignored it. Monsters aren't the only ones with valuable cores. Every mage cultivates a mana core of various types. For you who wields the dark element, the crystallized mana formation attached to his ribcage is a great material for study. 
Dirk turned back to the mage in silence, who had irrepressible fear in his eyes. Unfortunately, Dirk's knife dropped without hesitation or mercy. Chapter 130 Lightning Snakes Dirk walked back with a bloody ribcage in his hand, slipping it into his pocket ring and arriving before the Grand Marshal. She nodded at him with a pleasant smile. You're ruthless. That makes me want to recruit you even more. Anyway, let's not spare that heinous bastard another thought. I hear you want to join me on this little expedition to the Major Dungeon. Hmm. Dirk nodded with a neutral expression. It wasn't really him, but Pandora who wanted to go. Very well. Myself, Marshal Strider, Dirk Strider, and the Princess. If we're leaving, let us go now. I have things to do after this as well. City Lord Baron, you have full authority over the troops here in our absence. Take care of yourselves. Of course, Grand Marshal. The City Lord bowed a bit. Then, the Grand Marshal retrieved an item from her pocket ring. It was a large carriage, and according to the magical signature inside of it, Dirk recognized it to be a flying carriage. Let's go! With a wave, everyone boarded, and they took off. It wasn't long before they arrived in front of the major dungeon. This dungeon was located in a grassy plain, specifically a small forest in this plain amongst thick foliage. And all around the entrance were thousands of monsters that frequently attacked and ate each other. Upon flying toward the ground, several monsters sought to attack the carriage, but they were annihilated when an inferno surged from the vehicle. It wiped out everything in a small area, allowing the carriage to land without issue. Then, everyone stepped out. Ethan took the lead and killed anything that got close with small bolts of fire. These monsters were all around Tier 4 on average, but they were far beneath him. Of course, they were also beneath Dirk and Pandora despite them being Tier 4s as well. However, neither of them were as powerful as Ethan or the Grand Marshal, so they couldn't kill these creatures with absolute ease. It would still take them a small bit of effort. After retrieving the carriage, the Grand Marshal looked to the major dungeon entrance. Like all dungeons, the entrance to this one was a murky black portal that led to another space. They approached it, Ethan killing anything in their path. And then, they entered it. Dirk pushed through the uncomfortable fluid was engulfed, and after a brief moment of suspension, was spit out on the other side. The instant he was let out though, he saw the face of a monster lunging toward him. He didn't even think before his reflexes kicked in, and in but a half second, he planted a knife in the monster's throat backed by the strength of his anima. His body then spun and flung the monster away using its momentum. And after taking a survey of his surroundings, Obsidius covered his body. Ethan had released a small inferno around himself and was dashing around while slashing monsters. The Grand Marshal was also killing a few monsters that got too close, though she was far more relaxed than Ethan. And Pandora was standing not far from Dirk, two monsters writhing on the floor in pain as ice slowly froze their bodies from their feet to their head. It only took a dozen seconds for the immediate area to be cleared out. After the four regrouped, Ethan glanced at Dirk with an odd expression. Those were some shockingly fast reflexes. Thanks? Dirk wasn't sure how to respond to that. Nonetheless, Ethan seemed to be conflicted. Ethan had heard about what happened to Dirk straight from his father. The torture, the training, the curse that blinded him, his time at Azura's Mountain. The result was a monster that could fight an entire tier above himself, and one that could kill thousands of those below him. When he had first arrived, Ethan had seen the unbelievable skill that Dirk displayed while battling monsters. His agility, situational awareness, and ruthlessly acute attacks weren't normal by any stretch of the word. His combat sense was far above even his own, and Ethan was a tier 5, as well as a rank 6. Dirk was showing the skill and proficiency of someone like the Grand Marshal, and the only reason Dirk couldn't compare to a duke was because a tier or rank 8 had abilities that transcended anything like skill or reflexes. They were monsters themselves. Perhaps he was comparing himself, but Ethan wasn't sure how to feel about this brother of his. Ethan had surpassed rank 4 at Dirk's age. But even if he were to regress to that power now, Ethan couldn't fathom being able to beat Dirk on even terms. 
That thought ate at him. All right, listen close. The Grand Marshal suddenly turned to everyone, interrupting Ethan's conflict. She looked at Dirk and Pandora. You guys might be able to take care of yourselves in the shallow parts of the dungeon, but I have orders to go deeper. As soon as we start encountering Tyr SIXS, you need to stay out of the way. I can kill just about anything in this place, but you also need to make it easy for me to protect you while doing so. Ethan will guard you in case anything happens. Now, let's move quickly. With that, the group took off in a run. The dungeon was unlike any other landscape Dirk had ever seen before. It even surprised Pandora. The dirt was solid black, while the grass and foliage that grew atop it was red. The sky was also an odd green color. As for the monsters, the group immediately encountered one main type. Massive serpents that were two feet thick and a few dozen feet long. All of them were red, and from their scales came blazing flame. They were also tier five. Upon seeing these monsters, Dirk let out a long breath. After watching them fight, he figured that just three of these snakes could kill one of the monster generals that he did. That meant that Dirk could, at most, kill between six and nine snakes. Ethan, on the other hand, was going around slaughtering them like chickens. While his flames were almost ineffective, his rank six strength allowed him to cleave the heads off snakes with relative ease. And the Grand Marshal had it even easier. Dirk had already figured out that the Grand Marshal was strictly a body refiner with rank 7 anima. For scouting missions like what she was tasked to do, someone with concentrated power and mobility was best. So she was the perfect one to head in here and complete the mission quickly. And, on top of her rank 7 strength, her ability to wield anima was that of a bishop class. A bishop class warrior developed their own unique way of controlling anima. Dirk's mother Cecilia was able to create threads that were not only terrifyingly sharp, but could also turn invisible and intangible. For her, it was the perfect complement to her assassin skill set. But for this Grand Marshal, her special anima ability was forming something like a shield. No stray attack was able to touch her as whenever one would hit her, a translucent barrier would form in front of her body, protecting her completely. It allowed her to attack without worry or restraint. And while Dirk could definitely see its use, in his opinion it was a waste. Something like his mother's ability was far more useful. If his mother and this Grand Marshal fought, then his mother would win without contest. He had no doubt about that. As Dirk evaluated the Grand Marshal, the group constantly moved forward. No monster could last even a few seconds before Ethan and the Grand Marshal, so they advanced through fields of red quickly. It wasn't long before they began encountering new monsters. Occasionally, they began seeing snakes that were black instead of red. These snakes seemed to have scales made of metal. And the shocking part was how they actually wielded lightning. Dirk became focused when they encountered these. The black snakes were also tier 6, so they wielded destructive lightning that could hurt even Ethan if he weren't careful. Dirk was only concerned with their magic though. Through his mana vision he was able to see the extraordinarily concentrated lightning within their bodies that occasionally flickered across their metal scales. That was only part of the surprise though. The snakes were fast. They had reflexes and speed surpassing Ethan's, so even he could only hold one off, not necessarily kill it. It was the Grand Marshal who had to expend plenty of effort to get her hands on one and safely kill it. But thankfully those snakes didn't die fast because while watching them, Dirk was wholly concentrated on watching how the lightning moved through their bodies, and how it affected their reflexes. Dirk had learned plenty of lightning theory from that stolen book Geralt gave him, but in the end he was only able to develop spells that emitted lightning. And he wasn't really inclined to use many of those spells because as he found out, they were rather inefficient, taking lots of energy for average power. But if he could mimic those snakes and use lightning to increase his speed and reaction times, then he would unlock a whole new level of combat when integrating his anima. And that was only a shallow mimicry of what they could do. The lightning attacks from those snakes was incredibly destructive, far surpassing Ethan's fire. The snakes were able to whip their tails and use them to release strikes of lightning, and all of those strikes had horrifyingly dense energy within them that gave equally devastating results. 
so Dirk watched everything, tracking the movement of lightning mana with his mana vision. At the same time, he experimented with the lightning mana in his fire mana heart. Pandora glanced at Dirk, watching as sparks of lightning flickered across his fingertips. Runes would also occasionally appear around his hands, signifying his deepening comprehension into the nature of lightning. And on the inside, the changes were even more pronounced. Dirk could feel electricity rush through his limbs at his command, almost as if he were taking control of the nervous system that gave direction to his body. It made him twitch, his muscles contracting whenever a bolt of lightning would pass through them. He sent lightning through every part of his body. However, in doing this he found a limitation. Dirk had been working on his destruction cycles for groups of muscles, and he had completed a few groups already. When he passed lightning through these groups, they were able to take advantage of the lightning in contract with great strength and speed. But when he did the same through unrefined muscles, they were injured in the contraction process. If he were to force it, he might be able to give vast strength to his entire body, but only a couple of times. In order to take full advantage of this technique, he needed to finish muscle destruction, which had begun only recently. That meant he would need at least another six weeks before he could fully utilize that lightning amplification. But he still learned all he could. Dirk never did much with lightning, so this would help him use the resources at his disposal, giving purpose to his wide arsenal. It was good to have more variety other than stabbing with knives and shooting metal and fire bullets. And thankfully for him, the black lightning snakes only appeared more frequently. The Grand Marshal moved as fast as she could through the dungeon, and while that meant the black snakes died just as fast, the deeper they went, the more black snakes they found. So Dirk was able to continue to watch and observe the lightning techniques those snakes used. However, after a dozen or so black snakes were killed, Dirk noticed something going on with Obsidius. The little blob that was currently acting as his armor was usually quiet. It most enjoyed being used, as weird as that was. But as Dirk watched the snakes, the blob began to roil in desire. Dirk could feel the armor massage his hands, as if it were gnawing on his fingers. He could also feel its focus on the black snake. Specifically its corpse. It wanted the corpse. Hmm. Dirk tilted his head. He knew that there was much more to Obsidious than he knew, and using the blob as an armor was probably its most basic function. Now, seeing the blob's desire for something, he decided it was best to listen. Pandora. Yes? Pandora turned to him with a bright smile. I want some of those black snake corpses. How much space in those pocket rings do we have? Hmm, in anticipation for the valuable materials we would encounter in this dungeon, I brought a couple dozen rings with me. Adding up their total volume, I'm pretty sure we could bring every monster in this dungeon out of here. Catch. Ting. Pandora flipped a pocket ring in the air, one embedded with a tier 6 dark mana crystal. Dirk caught it and checked the space inside of it. Sure enough, it had a few thousand cubic meters worth of space. And that was just a single ring. Since that was the case, Dirk could use it without inhibition. Neither the Grand Marshal nor Ethan seemed to be interested in these snakes as their corpses were just left behind. So, Dirk began stuffing them into his ring. Even going back to grab the few they left behind. Like that, several hours passed with the Grand Marshal only moving faster and faster. When they weren't fighting a monster, everyone was running at almost full speed. The dungeon had massive wide-open landscapes, and Dirk heard that dungeon divers could spend upwards of two months inside one of these dungeons. If that was the case, they wouldn't be leaving in one or two days. This also meant that Dirk could collect more materials, though he wasn't yet sure what he would be using them for. Like that, they ran for approximately 30 hours. It was only then that the Grand Marshal decided to stop and take time to rest. She even had a portable living space. From her pocket ring manifested a massive tent that was fitted with everything someone might need. With enough space, one could carry around an entire house with them, so it wasn't too surprising. Even Ethan had a similar mobile living space that he brought out. Fortunately, Pandora wasn't to be outdone. Though, the item she brought out was a bit more surprising. You brought the car? 
Why wouldn't I? Why didn't you bring it out earlier? We could have been driving instead of running. Hey, I didn't know what the dungeon was going to look like. But tomorrow we can use it since we know now. Pandora shrugged, causing Dirk to sigh. He wasn't lazy, but why would he run at full speed for a day straight when he didn't have to? It wasn't like he had to fight. Oh, also. Suddenly, Pandora waved her hand, activating her ring again. Then, a small building appeared, creating a small rumble as it touched the ground. It almost looked like some kind of vault, similar to the forge room that Dirk's dwarven master had used at the academy. It's a smithy. I hadn't brought it out since you were so busy fighting all those monsters in the city, but since you're collecting materials now, I suppose it's an appropriate time to show it to you. You can keep it in your ring when you're done with it. I'm going to sleep. Pandora waved with that and headed to the car where her comfortable mattress was. The Grand Marshal had also retreated to her living space, and Ethan to his. Dirk decided that he wasn't so tired though. He was more interested in what Obsidius wanted, as even now its anxiousness hadn't diminished. So, with everyone retired for a time, he entered the vault. It was finally time to utilize those forging skills that he had been taught so long ago. Chapter 131, Blueprint Dirk was pleasantly surprised when he entered the forge vault. Inside was an anvil with enchanted lines running down it, a fire pit, and a table and rack full of every forging tool imaginable. Everything was exquisite and most definitely expensive. There were even multiple hammers, one for each of the elements. Each one had enchanted lines with differing designs matching the element they were enchanted with. Well, that made it easy for Dirk to pick which hammer. Grabbing the hammer with red enchanted lines representing the fire element, he walked over to the wide table that sat next to the anvil. There, he brought out one of the black snake corpses. Its head had been chopped off, but otherwise it was in perfect condition. Dirk ran his fingers down the sleek scales. From head to tail they were smooth like glass, but in the opposite direction, Dirk actually found himself get a small cut from how sharp and metallic the scales were. These scales granted them amazing defensive capabilities. As Dirk was admiring the scales, Obsidius jumped off of him and landed on the scales of the snake. Then, it continued to bounce around. Dirk watched, and thankfully, he could somewhat feel the intent of the blob. It wanted him to do something with these scales. But he didn't know what. Should he make armor with it? He already had Obsidius for armor. Seeing as how Dirk wasn't understanding, the blob stopped bouncing and shook a bit. Then, it expanded into its armor form without Dirk's body, though it seemed unsteady as it did so. The walking armor pointed at the scales. Then, it pointed to its arm. It went back and forth like this as its body shook before Obsidius could no longer independently hold that form. The blob retracted, continuing to jump on the snake. You want me to add the scales to you? Obsidius jumped even faster, signifying its confirmation. But that begged another question. How was he supposed to add these scales to Obsidius? Just as Dirk thought of this question, Obsidius moved again. It went over to the chopped off head of the snake. There lay a few scales that had fallen off the body. The blob rolled over a few of the scales, and they disappeared within. Then, Dirk saw the scales reappear on top of the blob, as if it had become a part of it. Obsidius had absorbed the scales and merged them into its body. If that was the case, could Obsidius absorb armor and use it to supplement its armor body? Create armor, and let you eat it. Obsidius kept bouncing, as if shouting yes yes yes. Interesting. Dirk slowly nodded his head. The armor body of Obsidius was indeed completely bare. But with this function, Dirk could enhance it with other sets of armor, allowing its strength and abilities to rise. Currently, Obsidius' armor only had the durability to naturally resist low tier or rank attacks. Anything around tier 4 would damage it and could hurt Dirk underneath. The only way Dirk knew how to increase its defense was by infusing his anima into it, but that took lots of energy, especially over long periods of time. But with this, Dirk's mind suddenly lit up with several ideas. All of those ideas though required him to forge a set of armor. 
In that case, Dirk had two items that would allow him to forge a high-quality set of armor. First, he had tons of dead lightning snake corpses, all of them having scales of metal. If he created a set of armor out of those, then he would be able to easily defend against the attacks of a tier 5. Plus, with the scales being so numerous and the size of a fingertip, they would be able to cover every inch of his body. The second item that would make for good armor was the turtle shell. The turtle general Pandora had killed had an oppressively strong shell that didn't so much as get scratched by her hurricane of bloody ice blades. It was only the completion of her atrociously powerful spell that could pierce through it like a needle and kill it from the inside. That turtle, despite being a tier 5, had defensive power even above the lightning snakes that were tier SIXS. He still had the shell, which was in basically perfect condition. It would make for a truly wonderful addition to the armor. The black snake scales and a turtle shell. Two fantastic materials for making armor. Only problem was. Dirk wasn't entirely sure how to handle these items. Dirk had only forged with metal, and he had only made tools and some simple pieces of armor like gauntlets or helmets with Sir Tobastin. He had never used monster materials in any kind of creation. This was new territory. Suddenly, Spite chimed in. You can skin the snakes, but if you stitch together those hides, then the stitching would be the weak point. The armor would fall apart under attacks. Plus, it would look like patchwork. On the other hand, we don't have other large leather hides that you could transplant the scales onto, and that's assuming you could transplant the scales well. There is such thing as scale armor though. Sir Tobastin showed me how forge masters would make something like chainmail with metal rings, and then they would create scales of metal and hook them onto those rings after punching a hole through it. Dirk rubbed his chin while gazing at the small scales of the black snakes. Then, he waved his hand. The turtle shell within his pocket ring fell out onto the ground. It was a really large shell that easily surpassed the size of Dirk's body. That's how big the turtle had been. A walking fortress. Dirk walked over to the dark green shell, tapping his hand against it and feeling the texture and material of it. In his mana vision, he could also see the extraordinarily dense earth and metal mana within it. It's metal. Dirk came to this conclusion and was pleasantly surprised. I don't have metal ingots to forge with, but if this shell is metal, then I can reforge it, shape it into rings, and create scale mail armor with the snake scales. With chain rings made from that turtle shell, there won't be any weaknesses. Smart thinking. Of course. With a small smirk, Dirk's mind rapidly formulated a plan. Obsidius also bounced around with glee, liking the direction Dirk was moving. All right, Spite, let's begin the blueprint. Activate your runic tracing. Roger. At that moment, Dirk's mana vision lit up with lines. Because he no longer had eyes, he couldn't simply create a visual trace and measurement of the materials he was using. In that case, he had to transform what he was seeing in his mana vision into runes that detailed the materials and their products. With Dirk's comprehension into mana, creating simple measurements wasn't difficult at all. So before long, he and Spite were able to trace an image of the scales and shell in his mana vision, calculating the volume of the materials. Then, they took measurements of his body and determined how much of each material they would need. Dirk also began shaping the components of his product in his mind. For example, he shaped the rings that would be made of the turtle shell perfecting their every detail and taking things like the forging process into account. The links between the rings, their diameter and thickness, the holes that they would need to punch into the scales, the angle of the rings in relation to the scales as it laid against his body. Over time, more and more details were accounted for as Dirk began to shape a figure of mana within his mind. This virtual figure that he and Spite created seemed to be constructed of runes and hidden within the runic artwork were all the details pertaining to each component, of which there were thousands. But of course, the runic blueprint wasn't perfect at first. Getting the angles of the rings and their shape and connections around the body proved more difficult than Dirk imagined. He was constantly making corrections, as one problem would require several fixes in other areas to rectify. But it came together. 
with Spite's help, Dirk was able to standardize measurements and get proper calculations. In the end, he spent an entire four hours creating the blueprint in his mind. And by the end of those four hours, he had finished. A scale armor that covered Dirk's virtual figure from head to toe. There wasn't an inch of unprotected space. And with that blueprint completed, Spite could properly calculate the volume of necessary materials. The conclusion. You would have a good amount of turtle shell to spare. Really? Dirk was a bit surprised. He had thought that he might not have enough, let alone some to spare. Since the snake scales were small, there had to be thousands of little rings to hold them all. The result was an incredibly dense set of layered scales. While it made for fantastic protection, Dirk was worried that he wouldn't have enough turtle shell to forge into the rings. But his worries were unnecessary. He even had some to spare. With that extra shell, I suggest you make a stronger helmet, maybe even some gloves or vital protection on your torso. The helmet I can make. But as for the rest, maybe a weapon would be good. A weapon? But you already have a few that Pandora gave you. Short swords, hatchets, and even a spear. You've really only used the short swords, but you're covered in almost every aspect. What other weapons did you have in mind? Spite questioned curiously. Dirk was now proficient in many types of weapons, from spears to swords to bows, not to mention guns. With enough weapons, there wasn't any enemy that he couldn't take care of, so long as he had the strength to match. But Dirk had something a bit more unique in mind. Here. Suddenly, Dirk began creating another blueprint. On it, he outlined the weapon he was thinking of. Spite was silent for a long moment as she saw the weapon. This? Are you serious? Could we make it? Not sure. Give me a second. Spite began analyzing the blueprint. When she was done taking the measurements though, she sighed. No. If you plan on making a helmet, then you wouldn't have enough for the weapon. It's one or the other. Helmet it is then. Maybe we'll get the materials to make it later. Besides, I feel that other metals would make the weapon better. Void metal would be preferable, not that I know where to find that stuff. Dirk let out a light breath, not particularly disappointed. At that moment though, there was a voice. Void metal? What for? Dirk turned his head, resting his gaze on the figure who had entered the vault. Pandora looked at Dirk curiously. He was just sitting in a chair, not looking like he had done anything the entire night. Nothing. Just something I had in mind. H.M. Well, the Dark Kingdom has plenty of void metal, seeing as how we're the site of the densest source of dark mana in the world. I can get you really high-quality void metal, upwards of tier 7. Tier 8 void metal is a bit difficult though. We're accumulating a deposit of tier 8 void metal, but it won't mature for another few decades, so our current stock is regulated rather heavily. It's fine. I don't need it now anyway. Dirk hummed before standing and leaving the vault. After he was outside with Pandora, he used one of his pocket rings and stowed the entire vault away. So? Please tell me you did more than sit in a chair all night. Pandora asked as they walked toward their vehicle. The Grand Marshal and Ethan were already ready to leave, so the duo jumped into the car upon arrival. I blueprinted the armor I planned to make. Apparently Obsidius can absorb armors and merge with them, making his own armor body more powerful. So I plan to use the turtle shell and snake scales to make a set of armor. That blob can absorb armor? Impressive. And how did you go about blueprinting? I didn't see any papers. Runic tracing. Spite can permanently record runes. I made a virtual image with this runic tracing that details the set of armor. Oh really? I can do something similar. My book of life lets me store runes in its pages. The pages act as a magical conduit too basically removing the need to personally cast spells so long as the spell circles are already in there. Dirk was silent as Pandora began to drive after the Grand Marshal who had continued her hunt. Turns out, the Book of Life was really powerful. 
with Pandora's four attributes in that book, she absolutely had the largest magical arsenal in the world. Nobody had more variety than her. Plus, she could cast even complex spells with ease. This would only get more pronounced as she got stronger. Dirk could also mimic that function with the help of Spite who could copy spells. This function though had been integrated to a certain extent into his stigma. His pistol that acted as the runic medium for spellcasting allowed Dirk to instantly cast spells, should he know the spell well enough. Most of Dirk's spells were simple, and the ones that weren't were more obscure like stealth that required elemental manipulation. So for him, casting simple spells with his pistol was perfect. But even then, with Pandora's display while killing the turtle, he was finding out that he needed to advance his combat prowess quickly. And forging could help. If he could create weapons and armor tailored for himself, then he could increase his strength greatly. These thoughts went through Dirk's head as Pandora drove the car behind the Grand Marshal and Ethan. The two of them couldn't really help in their endeavors. Because the monsters only got stronger the further into the dungeon they went, Dirk and Pandora, who hadn't even reached Tier 5 yet, were nothing but baggage. Only Ethan could still fight with the Black Lightning Snakes, and come the end of the dungeon, only the Grand Marshal would be able to fight if Tier 7 monsters showed themselves. So, all Dirk and Pandora needed to do was stay out of the way. And they didn't have to do that while running all the time. Pandora had her magic truck, and now, she was taking full advantage of it. Not long into the ride though, Dirk grabbed one of the spare rings and tossed it to Pandora. Collect the black snakes. I'm going to sleep. Only if I get some blood later. Later. With a sigh of resignation, Dirk relaxed back and fell asleep. Though, not before doing another destruction cycle, as he needed to every night before bed. Chapter 132, Threaten After getting around eight hours of sleep, Dirk finally woke up from his slumber. With nothing to do, he was able to get more sleep than normal. Nothing had changed on the outside. The Grand Marshal and Ethan were still fighting snakes which seemed to dominate this dungeon. There were also other variations besides fire and lightning, such as a tier 6 magma snake. Those were able to control both fire and earth mana, producing a synergy that resulted in the power of magma. Only the Grand Marshal could kill that one, and she also took the body, according to Pandora who seemed to be irked by that. Regardless, the hunt for whatever the Grand Marshal was looking for didn't seem like it would end soon. So Dirk decided to finalize his plans for his armor. The entire armor consisted of turtle shell chains that were looped and fitted with black snake scales. Then there was the helmet that would be constructed from the spare turtle shell material. The construction process seemed simple enough, just a bunch of repetitive chain making. But Dirk decided to add a few more details that would make things convenient. One thing was snake leather that was woven underneath the chainmail. That would serve to keep things stable, like a foundation. It also acted as insulation since the lightning snake was not just powerful in terms of lightning, but also fire since lightning was a specialty of fire. Plus, he would have tons of leftover leather anyway after plucking the scales. This would put it to use and act as another thin yet significant layer of protection. He even blueprint leather boots that would integrate with the scale armor, as well as gloves. With all these things, Dirk finally felt like the armor could be considered fully blueprint. After that, he just needed to figure out how he would go about putting it together. That didn't take too long though considering how he made standardized pieces. And so, a few hours after he woke up, Dirk had everything prepared. Only problem was the fact that they were still driving. He cowed not bring out the vault to forge anything. So he waited until Pandora stopped a distance from where the Grand Marshal and Ethan began fighting more snakes. I think I'm gonna get out. Out? I wanna forge. I need the vault for that. Dirk spoke while checking his ring. He had been handed all the corpses that Pandora collected, and it was more than enough for what he wanted. Pandora gazed at Dirk for a few seconds before speaking. If you leave, that could complicate things. How so? Well, I'm not staying with you. I need to find out what this Grand Marshal is scouting for, so I'll continue to follow. 
But without you, she might get some funny ideas, like assassinating the oh-so-valuable vampire princess. Would she? I don't know. She doesn't seem like a loose cannon, but she's ruthless enough to make hard decisions. There would be nothing I could do if she decided to kill me. Pandora spoke with a weird smile, causing Dirk to doubt her seemingly helpless words. Right. Your presence is keeping them in check. But, if you're really eager, I suppose I can make do without you. I am curious about your forging skill after all, as well as your friend's ability to eat armor. I don't want to stop you. So go ahead and find a safe place. I'm sure you could survive the pursuit of a tier 6 snake should it come to that. All right. With her words, he jumped out of the car. Just as he was about to close the door though, she called out. Hey. Catch. Dirk snatched the orb that Pandora suddenly threw. It's a long-distance communication orb. It's built around a tier 7 light mana crystal, so it has plenty of juice for sending messages. Contact me if you need to. And keep that thing safe. There's a reason only nobles get their hands on such a thing. Oh. Thanks. Dirk nodded before stowing the orb away. Then, he walked away from the car and toward the battlefield that was calming down. Wanna try your hand? The Grand Marshal called out as Dirk approached, simultaneously crushing the throat of a snake. Dirk shook his head. No. I'm planning on staying here. I have something I want to forge. I knew that huge building was for something. Staying behind though is rather dangerous. I can handle myself. Dirk spoke with obvious confidence, causing the Grand Marshal to stare at him for a second before sighing. Very well. I've seen and heard about some of your skill, so I suppose running away wouldn't be difficult for you. Still, take this. The Grand Marshal threw an item over. Dirk caught it and inspected what looked like a necklace. An enchanted consumable. It'll teleport you 50 meters in any direction about three times. That should be enough to get you out of sticky situations. All right. Thank you. No problem. Keep yourself safe. If you use it, just think of it as a favor. She waved with a smile, afterward continuing on her way. Ethan also nodded to Dirk before following. Have fun. Pandora waved while driving past in pursuit. Given several seconds, they turned behind a hill, exiting his view. Dirk looked around the now quiet battlefield. That Grand Marshal must be rich, since she left most of the corpses behind. Ethan had been collecting some, but also seemed to leave many behind. Dirk doubted he had dozens of empty pocket rings like Pandora though, so he was probably only able to carry so much. After finding a nice secluded place to work, Dirk took out the vault and entered. The materials were still beside the table that Dirk had worked at, so he quickly formulated his steps. Spite. Since you've decided to use snake leather as the foundation, you'll need to prepare it first. Afterward you make the chains, and then the scales. All right then. Time to pluck some scales. Dirk mumbled while approaching a lightning snake corpse. Grabbing it, he spread it across an empty table. He inspected the scales closely, taking out a knife and moving them around to see how they grew off the snake. Looks like they're similar to nails. They grow out of the leather, so removing the scales would technically damage the surface of the leather. How thick is the leather? If it's thick enough, then surface damage wouldn't affect it much. Let's see. Preparing his knife, Dirk stabbed down onto the snake. Ting! The tip of the knife stopped at the scales, unable to even pierce through. Dirk's eye twitched before he remembered that this was indeed a tier 6 monster. A little more force then. Activating his anima, Dirk stabbed down again. He also stabbed against the scales, allowing the blade to catch and slide under. This time though, the blade caught in the leather of the snake, not entering more than an inch or two. Spite jumped on the table in its cat form, tilting its head at the pitiful attempt to cut the snake. So harvesting corpses recuries a certain level of strength too. Is that to say I'm weak? Well, I was gonna beat around the bush. But since we're just jumping right to the conclusions, Sure. 
Dirk smirked before pulling the knife out. Guess I'll need to use my aura. It'll be a good way to hone it. Hmm. With a nod, Dirk's knife suddenly took on a golden hue as an impressively sharp aura blade overlapped with the knife. Then, he stabbed again. This time, the knife smoothly glided into the leather of the snake. Afterward, Dirk used more anima to slide the knife around in order to slice along the length of the snake. As he quickly found out though, this process took tons of anima, rapidly draining the energy of his body. It also stressed his control over his aura. If he poured too much into it, the aura would go out of control and destroy the material around the knife, including the knife itself. But if he put in too little, he'd waste energy while failing the cut. Striking a balance between power and control was shockingly difficult. After all, Dirk had barely become a rook class capable of controlling aura like this recently. He hadn't practiced much except for a few times while protecting the city. Spite was right. This would make for much needed practice. So he continued to concentrate. With Spite there, he didn't have to worry about his back not being watched. Focus the blade. Focus the energy moving through the body. Control it. Dominate the volatile aura. Through sheer will, Dirk forced his aura to adapt to him, not the other way around. While he needed to learn how aura worked and moved, he was also unbending in how it should be applied. Dirk envisioned his aura and knife gliding through the snake's leather and scales. He envisioned his aura forming into the perfect blade that was as still and tame as metal and he forged his aura to be just like his vision. He constantly corrected himself, constantly changed his aura until it did as he wanted. But it still took time to realize the changes he wanted. After an entire hour, Dirk had barely cut down half the length of a snake. On top of that, his knife was eventually destroyed, snapping in half. He luckily had more, but if he didn't fix his aura, he would go through them quickly. That only meant he needed to get it right or fail and be forced to wait. He wouldn't be able to forge if he couldn't get this simple step down. So he buckled down once more and continued. Luckily his stamina was plentiful. Dirk was able to continue for another hour, and by the end of that hour, the knife was less damaged than before, able to be used a bit more. Plus, he had cut down the length of the snake. With that, he moved on to another snake he decided he would skin the leather of the first when he was tired. And halfway into the third hour, Dirk stopped when the second knife was destroyed. Taking that as his chance, he decided to rest and eat some food, replenishing his energy. In not draining his energy to the point of exhaustion, he could recover faster, especially as his body processed the food. And his body worked with gusto once food hit his stomach, digesting all of its dense anima and mana his restoration skill worked to bring him to his prime. And immediately after eating, Dirk went and skinned the leather, which was far easier than cutting through it. It didn't even take anima, allowing him to rest while working. At the end of the third hour, Dirk had skinned an entire snake, setting the long leather hide to the side. With that, he was one snake down. And he was rested enough to continue on the second snake. Stabbing down on the corpse, Dirk restarted the arduous process of cutting through more leather. This time though, he was able to cut for two hours before the knife was destroyed. Taking out a spare knife, he continued. Cut through the leather, eat some food, skin its hide, and repeat. Dirk's body was constantly working and recovering as he stressed his aura. And his control over aura rapidly solidified, making it easier and easier on him. But after around 12 hours, his body's recovery slowed down substantially, all the fatigue taking its toll. So he decided to do a destruction cycle using the remaining dregs of energy he had. For that, he used the bone of a strong anima monster. Drawing out that dense anima and streaming it into his muscles, he resonated it, and an unbelievable pain racked every cell of his muscles, every pain receptor screaming at him but his face was neutral, as if it weren't even happening. Dirk just went through the cycle like normal, and as soon as he was done, a large portion of his legs were black and red, the skin horribly cracked, almost like the curse over his eyes. With that, Dirk was officially tired. Grabbing a few spare blankets, he made himself comfortable on the ground, 
going to sleep as soon as his head touched his pillow. Spite watched him fall asleep before taking up guard outside, watching for any unwanted guests. Pandora watched lazily as the Grand Marshal fought a few lightning snakes. As for Ethan, he had tired out a while ago and was sitting on the sidelines. It had been several hours since Dirk was left behind. Nothing much had occurred except the now boring fights with more and more snakes. After a few minutes, the Grand Marshal killed off all the monsters. She never got tired, but that was because these enemies were below her. Seeing her finish, Pandora moved her feet and prepared to drive. Instead of running off like she usually did though, the Grand Marshal settled her gaze on the car. Pandora's eyebrows raised in mild interest, but when the opposition's eyes never moved, she smiled and sat up. There was a standoff for almost a minute, the Grand Marshal simply staring at the car. Then, Pandora exited, jumping out with an innocent smile. She leaned on the side of the vehicle, returning the stare. Is there something you need, Grand Marshal Vincent? Vincent was silent. After a few seconds though, she disappeared from her position, reappearing in front of Pandora. Pandora didn't so much as flinch though, continuing to stare at the woman who was now much closer. She didn't seem to care that she was in striking distance of an opponent whose specialty lay in melee combat. Vincent narrowed her eyes at Pandora. What is the vampire princess doing here? What do you mean? You invited me along. Don't be a smartass. I want to know what your objective is. Why are you following Dirk Strider? And what are you attempting to accomplish by doing so? Vincent gripped her blades. By all logic, Pandora's life was in her hands. She could take her head off in the time it took to blink. But Pandora was abnormally calm. No, she seemed to be having fun as she smiled and chuckled so cutely. I thought I already answered you, Grand Marshal. Dirk and I are on a super-secret mission involving the fate of the world. I couldn't possibly tell you about something so important. Cut the shit. Nobody like you would move like this without purpose. Tell me why you're with Dirk Strider. At Vincent's question, Pandora's face twisted a bit with an odd smile. What can I say? We're just so horny for each other. I mean, as soon as we met, Dirk couldn't seem to keep his hands off me. I don't think I've ever been so hot and exhilarated as when he came and jumped on me like a beast. My pussy just couldn't let him go after that. Disgusting. Vincent's face twisted. To hear such vulgar words from the mouth of a beautiful princess was nothing short of shocking. No royal, especially one of her standing, would ever utter such profanity. She was absolutely the first of her kind but it also frustrated Vincent, because Pandora was obviously toying with her. She raised her knife, pointing it at Pandora's throat. Before she could get close though, Pandora's hot smile cooled just a bit. Careful there. Cross a certain line, and you won't even be able to regret it. Oh? What can a little tear for mage like you do? Vincent sneered, her powerful presence releasing monumental pressure focused entirely on the girl in front of her. But Pandora let out a small huff in response, as if she didn't feel the intent to kill surrounding her body. As a mage, nothing. But as the Vampire Princess, daughter of the Vampire Queen, and most valuable asset to the current Noble Alliance, I could have you executed where you stand. Pandora's voice softened as she pressed forward just slightly. Don't think I'm so stupid as to come out here unprepared for people like you. If you don't want to gaze upon your heart as it beats outside your chest, then you should exercise some restraint. Otherwise, I won't. Pandora's eyes flashed with a hint of the madness within her as she leaned forward into the knife. When the blade crossed a certain threshold though, Vincent felt a small chill go up her spine, causing her to pull the knife and jump back a few feet. Seeing that, Pandora smiled and went back to her cute self. Ah, you are so close. Shut up you monster. Oh please, I didn't threaten your 42-year-old sister or your three children of 14, 18, and 21. I think that's pretty tame of me, considering what I had done only a few weeks ago. You! Vincent trembled ever so slightly, her eyes dilating in disbelief. She then gripped her knives in anger, 
but she knew she couldn't do anything. She reevaluated Pandora in her mind. She wasn't a princess. She was a madwoman who would stoop to any level, a dangerous freak with the shell of royalty. How else would this princess know about her sister and three children, for people who she treasured the most in this world? It wasn't like she was one of the dukes. She was one of the weakest rank sevens, in fact. And the fact that Pandora didn't mention her husband, who was actually estranged, showed that she knew just who to target. Who studied the personnel of an entire empire that thoroughly to know the strengths and weaknesses of someone as low-key as her, along with the people around them? That was a level of intellect that shouldn't belong to someone like her. Or, perhaps that's exactly what made her so freakish. Did Dirk know about this girl's true nature? Was there a side to him she didn't know about, and they really were entangled with each other? Did Pandora seduce him? If he did know about this freak and was in his right mind, then why would he travel with her? Just what was the goal here? So many questions, and every possible answer led Vincent down unpredictable paths. She couldn't wrap her mind around this situation. Everything before had pointed to them being decent friends. But now, Pandora's words and actions threw everything she knew out the window. In the end though, only one thought remained. Vincent resigned herself. Don't fuck with Pandora. Chapter 133, Forging Dirk slept only as much as he needed to, and thankfully, there were no uninvited guests that disturbed him. So after waking, he decided to go straight back to forging. Dirk had already cut and skinned for snakes at the cost of a few knives. Thankfully he had one knife left, but he needed to skin another snake with that single knife. Fortunately, he was able to do it. Treating it as a warm-up for the day, Dirk went and cut into another snake, focusing all his energy on cutting through it. He didn't know if he should be happy about his ability to cut through such a tough monster or disappointed in his struggle with it. Regardless, after a short hour and a half, Dirk had not just cut but skinned the entire snake. Like the other skins he had, he hung it on a rack in the vault. With that, he had five skins, which would provide plenty of scales and a proper amount of leather. Now came the hard part, as if skinning those tear six snakes wasn't enough. Dirk approached the shell of the turtle general that Pandora killed. Tapping it with his knife, he was able to hear a metallic reverberation. This shell wasn't made of calcium or any kind of soft or brittle organic substance, but cold hard metal. Not only that, but it was just over a foot thick. Considering the size and toughness of this shell, it was a wonder that Pandora managed to pierce through it so easily. Letting out a small sigh, Dirk grabbed a stool and sat beside the shell. The furnace within the vault didn't have any form of flames, and Dirk knew that this shell couldn't be melted with anything ordinary. In that case, he needed to utilize the source of living flames that he had. Obsidious. He called, and the little blob bounced from within his clothes. It slithered around before making its way atop the turtle shell. Obsidious had a living flame with it, and when activated, it looked like it was burning itself. Dirk needed Obsidious for this craft. Its living flames were hotter than any flames he could make with magic. The only issue was how to properly wield those flames and allow him to shape this massive shell into small wire for chains. Maybe we can melt the entire thing into one long wire and cut it. Then comes the problem of shaping that wire. If the wire is so weak as to simply be bent with your fingers, then that's a problem. Then how do you suppose I form this thing into wire and retain its strength? Dirk glanced at the cat who jumped up on the shell. Spite tilted her head, her beady golden eyes gleaming. That depends on your abilities. You can bend and shape metal with magic, right? You should start doing that and shape the chains as you would other weapons. As for the shell, you could just tear chunks off and work with portions at a time. But as you develop the chains, you also need to link them with the snake leather. So I need to construct both the chain mail and the leather, as well as integrate the scales, all at the same time so they can become one unit. Dirk sighed while thinking of the complex process of this armor's construction. Spite just nodded, her cat eyes flickering with amusement. Correct. Good luck with that. Where do you think you're going? Just as Spite was going to turn and walk away, Dirk snatched her by the scruff. 
we're suffering together, so don't you think you can just walk away and explore the world? I have no other enjoyment in my life. Excuse you, but you should enjoy being my most powerful weapon and trusted companion. I have a very boring and stuck-up companion who doesn't know how to have fun. I'm not that boring. Dirk scratched his head for a second before shaking it. Anyway, I'll need your help during most of the forging process. Only if I get vacation days as per union laws. Union what? Whatever. You can have breaks when I don't need you, but only if you patrol around while exploring. Each break must be two hours long and there must be three breaks minimum in a 30-hour period. Three hours and two breaks per day. Deal. I shall develop a contract. Or you can hurry up and leave since I don't need you right now. Pleasure doing business. With a quick hop, Spite jumped and trotted out of the vault excitedly. Dirk watched her leave before turning back to Obsidius who was bouncing on the turtle shell. His face was a bit confused. Did I just negotiate with my stigma? He seemed to ask that question to Obsidius, as the blob stopped its bouncing and wiggled in thought. Dirk hummed. Well, I guess you're the most normal one here. Care to help me out with this? Obsidius jumped again, this time onto Dirk's hand. Then, it split into two, covering both his hands up to his wrists. Obsidius became two gloves that revealed complex circuits going from the wrists to the fingertips where they came together. Dirk realized what this was. Living gloves. I was wondering what this was. Does it help with forging? Obsidius squeezed Dirk's hand in response. Dirk also felt its intent over their bond. It wanted him to send in his mana. All right. We need to heat up this turtle shell. Can you use your living flame? After his question, Obsidius settled and ignited, flames burning atop the metallic gloves. This time, Dirk was able to feel the flames in their entirety, such as the mana contained within them and how its power moved. Living flames supposedly had life or intelligence. What was special about Obsidius though was that he had a tangible body and was also the life and intelligence of the living flame contained within it. Needless to say, the couple who crafted Obsidius had to have been supremely intelligent. To be able to not only create life and intelligence, but give it such a versatile body and a living flame. Dirk couldn't imagine coming anywhere close to such ability. Now, Dirk had this marvelous specimen as his familiar. Several thoughts crossed through Dirk's head as he saw the gloves through his mana vision. He could see the flame most distinctly, and the metal of Obsidius was clearly outlined along with all the circuits that circulated with mana. Suddenly, some of Sir Tobastan's teachings resurfaced in his mind. The memory of Tobastan smoothing the blade of a knife with his fingers was a vivid one in Dirk's mind. Tobastan was able to manipulate metal mana with precision rivaling machines. Dirk had even seen him shape an entire sword with his bare hands, stretching and flattening metal like it was putty. Dirk was nowhere near replicating that kind of skill or elemental manipulation, so for just about all of the work, he needed to shape things with the hard strikes of his hammer. If it was that way, Dirk didn't have an issue making the wire out of the turtle shell. He could simply flatten and stretch the metal out until it was thin enough to be wire. After that, he could use elemental manipulation to smooth out the wire, which would surely be cubic due to his flat hammer strikes. Once it was cylindrical, he could temper it and make it proper wire. The tough part would come during the final shaping. Dirk needed to retain the strength of the wire, yet be able to turn it into chains. There was only one way he could do that in a way that also allowed him to integrate the wire with scales in the leather. He needed to bend it himself, and that would take elemental manipulation. So on top of solidifying his control over Aura, Dirk would need to stress his elemental control. If he couldn't do it, he couldn't make the armor. And he had no plans on giving up so easily. I guess I can only start. Shrugging, Dirk stood and began the first step toward making the armor. The wire. He looked at his hands, and then toward the turtle shell. All right, Obsidius. We're going to try and melt this thing. Just let me know what you need. Obsidius squeezed Dirk's hand in response. Then, he placed his hands on the shell. 
obsidious, burned with its living flame, immediately turning the glossy surface of the shell black. But after that, Dirk saw no signs of it turning as hot as it needed to be. It only reddened a bit. Dirk frowned. He could tell what the problem was. The power of the living flame was scattered and unfocused. It didn't take any power at all to ignite the living flame or keep it burning, but if Dirk wanted it to properly heat something, then he needed to guide its power with his own hands. That's when he streamed fire mana into the living gloves, making the circuits glow red. With that, Dirk could more properly feel the living flame, and he began to take control of it along with the guidance of Obsidius. He and the blob, who was now a pair of gloves, focused the living flame, and the results were immediate. The shell reddened more and more as the flame got hotter and more concentrated like a blowtorch. The only problem was that controlling the living flame, even with Obsidius, was taxing on Dirk's mental energy. He used the power of the fire element to directly manipulate the flames, but Dirk wasn't incredibly proficient with elemental manipulation. So like with his aura, this was a good training session. Dirk focused as much as he could, disregarding how much energy he used. His only focus was getting the task done. Like that, the potion of the shell he was placing his hands on to turn from red to yellow hot. Dirk could sense the metal and fire mana with the shell and how turbulent it was. This turbulence occurred when metal became hot enough to become malleable. It almost resembled atoms and how they moved more when heated up, eventually turning to a liquid. And Dirk knew his abilities well enough from Sir Tobaston's teaching. So, he waited until he saw a certain level of turbulence before acting. After the shell was already glowing, Dirk suddenly exploded with more power. His hands pressed down as his fingers gripped down like claws, and metal mana was forced along with his will. Then, with a burst of bodily strength, Dirk's hands scooped at the shell. Shing! The yellow hot portion of the shell was torn off, leaving a chunk of the metallic substance in Dirk's hands. He looked at the shell that rapidly cooled with a sigh. The part he tore off was barely a fraction of the entire thing. Well, gotta start somewhere. He said that before turning to the anvil. As he kept the living flame burning, the chunk of metal wasn't cooling down nearly as fast, maintaining its yellow hot color. He quickly got to work. He grabbed the hammer that was specially tailored to the fire element after deactivating the living flame. Then, with the gloves as the guide, Dirk was able to easily stream his fire mana into the hammer. The hammer head glowed with red circuits before the head itself became red hot. Dirk found it curious before slamming down onto the chunk of turtle shell that was beginning to cool. Ting! The hammer released a shower of sparks after meeting the chunk, flattening some of the jagged edges. Using some of his anima, Dirk raised the heavy hammer and slammed down again. Ting! More sparks, and through the hammer, Dirk was able to slow the cooling of the metal underneath. This was a technique that Tobastin taught, infusing elemental power through the swings of a hammer. Ting! Dirk's arms bulged as he swung the weight with full force. He had long developed the coordination needed to perfectly hit the material as he needed. When he first started, he would occasionally hit the anvil. Those reverberations tore the skin on his hands becoming painful lessons that he quickly learned from. Ting! The metal was continually shaped under Dirk's hammer that swung with enough force to split cold steel. He hit quickly in order to get as much formation as possible before the metal cooled. Ting! More sparks, and the few that landed on his shirt burned small holes in it. But with a thought, he stored the clothing away, continuing. Ting! One more hit, and finally, the metal had cooled enough to become too hard to deform, even with a hammer. So, Dirk just heated up the chunk again. Holding in both his hands, Dirk used the living flame to turn the chunk yellow hot again. With that, he continued the forging process. As he kept swinging his hammer, his manipulation of the fire element became more precise. The process took four hours, but eventually, the chunk turned flat. That's when Dirk grabbed it and began hitting its side to elongate it and make it thinner. The process was tedious and consumed lots of energy. Such work was thought of as laborious by many, and those who felt this way would look forward to their breaks. But not long after beginning to forge, 
Dirk fell into a trance. He constantly remembered those enjoyable days at Tobaston's forge room as he was harshly but skillfully trained. He remembered the split palms, the sore muscles, and the burns on his arms. The training hurt, but within what was normally seen as torment, Dirk found fulfillment and happiness. He fell in love with the process of shaping and refining metals, turning them from a hard lump into a masterful craft worthy of being wielded by the powerful. For Dirk, the comprehensions into the elements and growth in power came secondary to the feelings he felt during the forging itself. It was monotonous, only the constant sounds of metal on metal ringing in his ears. It was boring, only needing the robotic swings of his hammer. It was tedious, with much time needed just to flatten an ingot. But Dirk liked it. And as he flattened the lump of turtle shell, he realized once again just how much he enjoyed forging. He was actively focused during every second of the process, enjoying even the tiniest details such as the alterations in the angles of his hammer. Every strike was perfected and deliberate with dozens of thoughts analyzing its every move. Spite sat on a table not too far away, having come back long ago. She watched Dirk work for the several hours he was engulfed in his work. She saw the movement of mana, the fire moving from his gloves into the hammer. The percussive strikes that infused fire mana into the metal. The fire mana going in and out of Dirk's mana lungs with each of his breaths. Mana revealed so much more than the normal world. While they both had their beauty, in this moment, the world through mana was more enrapturing than the physical world. Spite knew that Dirk loved forging, and though she didn't personally understand why, she was beginning to see the beauty in it. At the seven-hour mark, the lump had become a long and thin rectangle that was on the verge of becoming a wire. But Spite could feel how Dirk was using up the last bit of his energy. His body was still strong, but his mental energy was running out. Using elemental manipulation for so long was taxing. But Dirk was able to finish, turning the lump into a long wire that was so rigid it didn't so much as curve off the anvil. After making one last strike, Dirk unsteadily set down the hammer and looked at the wire. It was cubic and rough, but that's what the more precise smoothing process was for. Tobaston called it the metal fingers technique by which one altered the shape of metal through the strength of their fingers and their metal mana manipulation. Naturally, only someone with the metal specialization could do this, so it was a very special technique. Those who didn't have this technique needed to use tools like grinders, which Tobaston thoroughly resented. Regardless, Dirk didn't have any energy to engage that technique. Instead, he went to a table and pulled out plates of food, scarfing down many of the meats and juices from inside the pocket ring. This served to revitalize him and regenerate his mana pools, though unfortunately, his mental energy was still drained. So after eating he took a nap. Spite watched him do so before walking up to his unconscious body and curling up under his arm. Chapter 134, Yuvos Several days passed as Pandora continued to linger behind her escorts. The driving got mind-numbingly boring for her, but it wasn't like she was going to turn back when she had come this far. Still, she often scowled and hoped that something would happen soon. She had thought that this dungeon scouting would be short and quick, and that she would be able to get on her way after the fact. But with each day of watching Ethan and the Grand Marshal slaughtering snakes, Pandora got more and more impatient. She was beginning to wonder if this expedition was really worth her time, or if she should have just sent an order back home for a team to scout one of their local dungeons instead. Whatever the case, when the sixth day came around, Pandora finally got to see just what exactly was piquing the interest of the Horizon Empire. At first things were normal as the Grand Marshal bound across the landscapes and Pandora sped after her. But then, they encountered something a bit more artificial. Standing tall like some kind of Parthenon, Pandora observed the enclosed temple that appeared. It was constructed out of pillars and walls of black rock. These black structures pulsed and glowed with cracks of lava that radiated pure fire mana. And the tops of the pointed structures sparked with electricity. One could feel the static in the air as it made their hair stand on end. And not just that. But even before coming close to this structure, Pandora began to feel an odd pressure that was placed on her soul. The pressure got worse as she approached, almost like the structure was surrounded by a domain. 
she recognized this pressure as someone who frequently encountered those more powerful than herself. The soul pressure of a higher existence. And not just any higher existence. Pandora smiled as she followed the Grand Marshal to the entrance of the building. Upon arrival, Pandora disembarked and stowed the car away, standing beside Ethan who was exhausted by the tiring and perilous journey here. How interesting. You've brought me to a dragon's abode, Grand Marshal. I've heard that some major dungeons also disappeared from the world after the advent. Seeing this major dungeon containing a dragon's abode, I can assume that the remaining dungeons all contain one such abode. That's why you're scouting dungeons, to confirm the existence of these abodes. Correct? The Grand Marshal was silent, keeping her gaze neutral and forward. After their little scuffle, the Grand Marshal didn't speak another word to Pandora, just ignoring her and continuing with her mission. Pandora didn't mind that much, of course. After a moment of silence, the Grand Marshal stepped forward onto the first step of the Parthenon. Once she did, the structure flared with fire, flashing as its glowing cracks spewed flames. The temperature rose several dozen more degrees despite how hot it already was, and even the Grand Marshal began to sweat. But as if she had already done this before, she continued on to ascend the staircase. It wasn't long before she reached the top and stood before a large pair of doors. Wow! It's a different kind of power, isn't it? Dragons are amazing. At that moment, the Grand Marshal was shocked to hear a voice beside her. It was Pandora. The two stood before the doors, Pandora looking around as if she were on a sightseeing trip. Disregarding how Pandora was resisting the heat and pressure, the Grand Marshal narrowed her eyes and pushed open the doors. It apparently took a significant amount of strength as even the Grand Marshal, a rank seven, had veins bulging on her arms as she pushed. Only after several seconds did the doors finally crack open and reveal what was inside. Unlike a king's hall in most dungeons, this pair of doors didn't lead to a portal to another space where you would fight the monster champion. Instead, the doors led inside the Parthenon structure, and Pandora was surprised to see an actual dragon laying within the Parthenon. As the princess of the Dark Kingdom, Pandora had witnessed the Dark Dragon Primordial emerge from the abyssal hole underneath the capital city every year. It was their most famous holiday and the only place in the world where you could go to easily see an actual dragon. But that was the Dark Dragon Primordial, an existence only lesser than a god. This dragon now before Pandora wasn't such a greater existence, but one lesser enough that she could clearly feel just how unfathomable it was. It wasn't simply an existence with more power than her. She knew what such pressure felt like and disdained it. No, this dragon radiated such a pure and unrestrained elemental aura that it felt as if the dragon was one with the element itself. It didn't feel like she was standing before a dragon, but the incarnation of the fire element, or more specifically, the lightning element. The dragon had dark red scales that almost shone black, with lines of electricity that fluttered underneath its scales while flashing a beautiful bright red color. It wasn't the standard blue lightning from the other snakes, but red lightning, something that felt far more potent. Not only that, but there were elementals made from pure red lightning that surrounded the dragon that seemed to be sleeping, one shapes like the snakes they had fought on their way here. These lightning snakes drifted while crackling with pure elemental mana. Even standing so far away Pandora could feel the polarity of the air make the back of her neck tingle. Worse yet, it seemed like these lightning elementals weren't friendly as they woke up and set their sights on Pandora and the Grand Marshal. But they didn't attack, instead dutifully standing guard around their creator, the dragon. As the two women stood there, Ethan gradually made his way up the staircase and through the doors. As soon as he stood beside them, the doors shut on their own, sealing them in the Parthenon. When all three were finally ready to face the dragon, it opened its eyes. For a long while there was silence as the dragon unfurled itself and rose to stand nearly fifty meters tall and a few times longer. The fire element seemed to bow to this dragon as it merely breathed and created waves of fire. But although it stared at them, it seemed to be thinking. Finally, after several minutes, its eyes widened. The time has come. It didn't speak in a normal voice. Instead, 
the three could feel its will transmit itself across the elements in a method more profound than mental transmission. There was a voice that spoke out in response to it though. If you're speaking of the war cataclysma, then yes, it has begun once again. Pandora's comparatively weak voice echoed in the Parthenon, causing Ethan and the Grand Marshal to look at her urgently, as if telling her she shouldn't be speaking lightly. But she naturally ignored them. Have you been in slumber all this time? You are a curious child. Yes, I have been in slumber, waiting for this day to come. Then why did you not wake? The call of the Dark Dragon Primordial was heard throughout the world a long time ago and should have roused all of you from your sleep. After all, you are naturally one of the many subjects he calls for support. So why didn't you wake earlier? Pandora questioned with a furrowed brow. One might think she was asking a random question, but in her mind that quickly surmised exactly what the Grand Marshal's purpose in coming here was, she found an outstanding problem. The Grand Marshal had come here to wake this dragon. This likely meant that, in this war cataclysma, the Horizon Empire was on the side of the dragons who were destined to fight against the two gods, Eldritch Primordial and Sovereign Divine. But this dragon shouldn't have remained asleep. As expected, the dragon before them flared in what seemed like rage. You are correct. I should not have been deep in slumber. I have failed to rise to the call of the primordials. This is not natural. Something, someone, has. The dragon, after shivering in anger, suddenly slowed and focused. Pandora could sense the man around the dragon kick up as lightning arced in the air. At that moment, it was as if the dragon had manifested some kind of mana body as it became translucent, almost ethereal. But in doing that, it encountered shocking resistance. That was when Pandora saw it. The dragon heart within its mana body that was constructed of the purest mana, and the invisible white chains that only Pandora could see latching down and sealing the heart. Someone had created an exceedingly complex spell and sealed this dragon with it keeping it from waking to the call of the Dark Dragon Primordial. Someone had sabotaged this dragon. Insolent. Blasphemous. Such underhanded cowardice. As expected, the dragon was further enraged by this revelation that it had been sneakily sealed while asleep. It shook while attacking the chains of light mana, attempting to obliterate them and free itself. But upon drawing from its dragon heart for power, Pandora was shocked to discover the chains become even more powerful, and the dragon collapsed with drowsiness. No, it wasn't drowsiness, but the inability to control its own existence. It was no different from a human having their heart kept from beating. This crippling spell threatened to put the dragon back into its slumber. The dragon knew this, of course, and as it failed to so much as stand on its own feet, it sighed. Ah, how weak have I become? To think I failed to resist such a petty trick. I am undeserving, unfit to be a subject of the vast darkness, the dark dragon primordial. Come on now, no time to indulge in self pity. I expected more, dragon. I didn't think your will was so easy to break. There was the familiar clicking of shoes on the ground as everyone turned toward Pandora, who was walking toward the dragon. The dragon narrowed its eyes. My will is not something neither humans nor vampires can imagine. Oh please, I know someone who has quite the unbreakable will. Granted, he may be one of the few people in this entire world with such level of willpower. Regardless, you're already giving up. Again, I expected more. Pandora stopped walking as she stood right before the dragon's head. The size of its mirror compared to her entire body, let alone the rest of it, was massive but she wasn't any less noble in front of this colossal existence. She stood with her chin up, as if challenging the dragon to a contest of nobility. The Grand Marshal and Ethan half expected the dragon to crush her where she stood. Even while restrained, this dragon wasn't something Pandora could fight against. Its mere thoughts were still able to call upon the elements and produce shocking power. Perhaps only the Grand Marshal could fight against it, and Ethan merely achieved the feat of running away. But Pandora was a bug before a demigod. Shockingly though, the dragon didn't retort against Pandora. Instead, it sighed once more. You are right. Perhaps the passage of time has made me complacent. Excuses. 
but I'm glad you see where you've gone wrong. Anyway, I've planned to help you regardless, so prepare to cooperate. Pandora brought up her hand while saying that, summoning her stigma, the Book of Life. And upon seeing that book, the dragon before her shivered, its eyes widening, and its head bowing down. You are. Ah, stop there. I have secrets to keep. Pandora smiled and put her finger over her mouth, telling the dragon to keep quiet. It did as she wished. Very well. Tell me how you plan to help. I'm going to fight your seal. I can't fight it on equal grounds with my power, but I can match it in complexity. For a time it will be weakened as I attempt to dismantle it. That opening is when you need to join and destroy the seal with your sheer power. I understand. Good. Be grateful, dragon. I'm going to be expending all of my power for this. With those words, Pandora began. Light mana erupted from her body in a torrent, the Book of Life floating up before her and flipping its pages erratically. Her light mana promptly pierced into the dragon, who didn't raise any resistance. With that, her light mana found the chains and seal that weakened the dragon. She dived straight into the seal, exposing its complexity and rapidly creating countermeasures that wrote themselves into the Book of Life. Before long the dragon suddenly felt some of its power return as a portion of the seal was blocked by Pandora. Feeling that, it got eager, but Pandora interrupted it. Not yet. Don't activate your heart until I tell you to. She yelled while infusing more of her power that spun with a whirlwind inside the dragon's body. This whirlwind accurately targeted certain portions of the seal and chains, causing them to falter and weaken. The dragon regained more and more of its power, but it didn't activate it. This continued for a while. 10%, 20%, 30%. Its power was unlocked, but at an increasing cost to Pandora. She even brought out a tier 6 mana crystal, sucking away its mana and dumping it into her spell. This boosted its performance even more at the expense of consuming far more mental energy. And then, after several minutes, the dragon felt an entire 37% of its power become unlocked. Pandora shouted. Now! I will not let go of this chance. The dragon vowed, and with an explosion of fire and lightning, the dragon fought through the opening and attacked the seal. The moment the dragon heart became active, the seal lit up and the chains appeared visibly, crushing the dragon heart in an attempt to seal it once more. But with Pandora's opening, the dragon was still able to use a significant portion of its heart. It attacked with wild abandon, hinging its entire existence on this battle. Explosions of fire and lightning filled the Parthenon, each one of them capable of reducing Ethan and the Grand Marshal into piles of ash. But they didn't hurt them, the mana simply passing through them harmlessly. The Grand Marshal was in awe at the display. Truly, dragons represented the pinnacle of elemental manipulation. But what shocked the Grand Marshal even more was Pandora's power. Her light mana resisted the seal that could restrain such a powerful dragon heart. And only with the opening she created was the dragon able to resist. And it resisted with all its power. It was a monumental battle of the elements. And for a time, nothing seemed to happen. But then, the Grand Marshal saw one of the chains around the dragon heart snap. Clang! An explosion of light mana washed over them when the chain broke, and with it, the dragon was able to exercise even more power. And every inch that it gained was more to use against those chains that bound it. Before long, the second chain broke. Clang! After that, the battle was decided. The dragon only attained more power, and it only became easier to destroy the seal. Like that, chain after chain snapped. When the dragon had broken half the chains, Pandora shut down her spell and collapsed backwards. A mattress appeared behind her, catching her body. But even then, blood pooled in her mouth as she felt horrible weakness and pain overcome her body. Thankfully the dragon no longer needed her. It only took another minute for it to destroy the remaining chains and obliterate the entire seal, leaving no trace behind. Once the chains were broken, the dragon stood once again, raising its head and roaring into the sky. I have awakened. The lightning dragon Uvos will now respond to the call of the primordials. And 
the dragon Yuvos bent down toward Pandora, seeing her pitiful state. I thank thee for your assistance. Is there anything I can do for you? Irk. Sorry. Pandora coughed as she spat out a name. Get. Dirk. Chapter 135, Sovereign Church. It had taken several days, much trial and error, and a constant honing of his skills. But finally, Dirk was able to start the armor. He couldn't simply bring materials together and think it was finished. This armor wasn't a solid piece, but a mass of intertwined chains, scales, and leather. It was atrociously complex to be Dirk's first official craft, but he was pushing himself to do it anyway. It was because he knew what to do. He had everything blueprint. His only issue was actually carrying out the tasks, and he wouldn't allow himself to ease the challenge just because he couldn't get things right on the first try. So he continued to force himself to hone his craft. And the two abilities he focused on most were aura and elemental manipulation. He needed aura manipulation so he could simply cut snake leather, and he needed to manipulate the elements in order to smooth out and properly shape metals like the wire so he could make chains. And in the end, elemental manipulation gave him the most issues. The living gloves assisted him greatly in the focus of his mana, but manipulating it with enough strength to shape the metal proved to be far more difficult than Dirk imagined. Smoothing a wire was one thing, but bending it was another. Not only did he have to create proper chain links, but he had to bend the metal while linking it with another chain, hooking on a scale, and weaving it through the leather. All these variables made it far more difficult, and Dirk was hard-pressed to even start the armor. But after several days of constant attempts, he was able to link a few chains. On the table within the vault was a mess of leather strips, scales, and tiny lengths of wire. Dirk had long since forged almost the entire turtle shell into wire, so now, he just needed to piece everything together. But there was one other issue that plagued him. The scales. They were big enough for the chains, yet still small enough to give him trouble. He needed to poke them with holes that were big enough for the chains, but heating the scales proved abnormally difficult. Though it shouldn't have surprised him. These scales could conduct the extreme lightning of those snakes, so it would obviously be able to absorb heat without getting damaged. The pile of scales that he had managed to poke holes in was small, but he still managed to succeed, so it was only a matter of spending the time. Dirk was proud of his work in progress, and he continued to work on it for as long as he could. But then one day, as Dirk was twisting some more wire, he suddenly felt a vast aura wash over the vault. For a moment he thought there was a black snake outside since the aura caused the air to turn static. But the aura was far too powerful, placing down a measurable pressure on his soul. And Dirk recognized the kind of aura, that shapeless power of a higher existence. Dragon. Dirk was baffled, wondering why he was sensing the presence of a dragon. Until Spite, who was outside the vault, suddenly shared her vision. Dirk. It's an actual dragon. Through his mana vision he could see clearly the being that seemed to be composed of lightning itself. All other mana was washed away as this elemental god landed before the vault. Dirk's mind scrambled for explanations, wondering what he should, or could, do in the presence of something so powerful. Though more than that, he was wondering why a dragon was here at all. Until it spoke. Dirk Strider. Yes? Dirk answered back at the call of his name, even more confused than before. Then, Dirk recoiled when he saw the head of this dragon poke through the wall of the vault, as if it weren't material. It looked directly at him with eyes of lightning. I am the lightning dragon Yuvos, and I am here to retrieve you. Why? Your friend requires your help. Friend? Oh. Dirk's face fell as he recalled Pandora. What the hell did she do now? That can be explained another time. For now, I will take you to my abode. Saying that, the dragon backed up and released a wave of lightning mana. This mana wrapped around Dirk, carefully cradling him before restraining him. Dirk! Spite shouted before recalling herself to Dirk's soul, taking form as a tattoo. Then, the dragon flapped its wings, taking to the sky. Lightning crackled all around its body, 
connecting to the heavens and the earth. And with a flash, a streak was created, flying beyond the horizon and leaving behind a thunderous roar. Dirk momentarily arrived within the abode. There on a mattress was Pandora. There was a bit of blood coming out of her mouth, but otherwise she looked fine. Dirk walked over to her, disregarding the Grand Marshal and Ethan who were sitting to the side. The Grand Marshal had a complicated gaze as she watched Dirk kneel by Pandora. Hey! What the hell did you do? I'm dying and that's how you greet me. Pandora smiled weakly, letting out a rough voice that seemed to highlight whatever injuries she had sustained. But Dirk wasn't buying it. His face was only doubtful. You're not dying. Your body is sucking for mana though. What, cast a hard spell and couldn't handle it? I just unsealed a damn dragon. Cut me some slack and let me suck on you for a bit. Please? Pandora looked up at Dirk pitifully. Before he gave in though, he looked over to Ethan and the Grand Marshal. Did she unseal a dragon? She did. Ethan answered, but it didn't sound like he believed in himself. Still, Dirk could sense the gaze of a massive lightning dragon behind him, so Pandora probably wasn't lying. The dragon even bent down his head and spoke. She is the only reason I've awoken from my slumber. A cunning conspiracy is underfoot, and she thwarted the seal that prevented me from responding to the call of the primordials. I have no idea what any of that means, but I guess you aren't lying. Dirk sighed as he looked back down at Pandora. She smiled and packed the mattress beside her. Come. I just need some of your thick juicy essence. Good God. Fine. If it gets you to shut up. Dirk rubbed his temple before sitting on the mattress beside her. Smiling widely, Pandora pulled her body over and exposed the tattoo of the blood pact she and Dirk had made which remained on his neck even now. Dirk felt her fangs pierce into his skin, targeting his arteries and drawing blood from them. The blood pact activated, allowing the easy transfer of blood. Mmm. -hmm. She moaned in delight as she drank. Ethan's face scrunched in confusion while the Grand Marshal's thoughts ran wild. Dirk let her have her way for a while, that was until she started sucking down more than a liter of his blood. That's enough. Mmm. Off. Now. Mmm. Reluctantly, Pandora pulled away licking the stray drop of blood that went down her lip. The wound she created healed instantly, some sort of useful byproduct of the blood pact. Now, while Dirk felt a bit anemic, it was nothing he couldn't regenerate quickly. At least Pandora seemed much more rejuvenated. Still, Dirk was a bit baffled. Do you have an abnormally large stomach or something? How can you drink so much? Blood isn't simply a liquid to digest but essence to absorb. I can drink as much as I want. But because our blood pact is weak, I don't get as much efficiency out of your blood as I would if our pact were deeper. That's the only reason I needed to drink so much. Pandora explained while pulling herself to her feet. She shot him a glance. If we made a deeper pact, I could drink half the blood and get double the essence. Even more so if it were a life's blood pact. But if we went that far, I'd only ever be able to drink your blood. That's no different from getting married, at least in vampire culture. Marry you? Dirk asked with a repulsed face, causing Pandora to narrow her eyes at him. Hey, do you know how many people want to marry me? Nobles would go to war with each other over the chance. If not for the few questionable deaths of several noble heirs, there would be crowds of suitors flocking after me. Pandora flicked her hair back, as if it were something to be proud of. But her words only confirmed Dirk's apprehension toward her. He shook his head. Whatever. Now explain everything. Fine, fine. Rolling her eyes, Pandora explained everything she knew about her encounter with the dragon and the seal that had kept it asleep. She also added in her speculations, and looked toward the Grand Marshal at a certain point. Grand Marshals of the Horizon Empire are being tasked with investigating these major dungeons and the dragons within them. I'm going to take a guess and say that your Emperor Horizon wants these dragons active. But this thing with the seal definitely goes deeper. I'm afraid another power is revealing itself. 
Another power? What kind? Dirk asked curiously. As far as he knew, there were only five major powers in this world, which were the five empires of the world. Pandora scratched her head. Not sure, but this definitely isn't the only dragon that's been sealed. If it's local to the Horizon Empire then we don't have to worry too much. But I have a feeling that it's worldwide, as only a power with really high tier light mages can seal a damn dragon, and such a power wouldn't remain confined to only a single empire. In that case, we're dealing with something that has influence in every empire, and specializes in light magic. The Sovereign Church. The Grand Marshal suddenly blurted out, causing Pandora to smile. Wow! I think you just confirmed my guess. You guys know about the sealed dragons? I can't say. The Grand Marshal backed off, but it seemed like she was silently confirming Pandora's question. It made Pandora smile even wider. Good. In that case, you guys are actually lucky. The Sovereign Church has the weakest influence in the Horizon Empire, something your emperor remained adamant about. I wondered why he didn't like the church, but if they're sabotaging the dragons, and your emperor wants the dragons awake, then I can assume that in this war they'll fall on opposite sides. It's amazing though that such things have been developing for many years past. Jeez. I came into this world too late. Pandora sighed. While Dirk wasn't able to follow her train of thought, he could understand the conclusions. He had only heard of the Sovereign Church in passing. He had never seen anything related to that church though, so he assumed it was just some random cult that took advantage of small villages. But it turned out to be a far more significant power than he thought. In this global game of war that was beginning to blaze, they were a main player. Pandora clapped. Well, looks like they aren't called the Sovereign Church by coincidence. Anyway, it's about time we got out of here. Grand Marshal over here needs to report back to her Emperor, and I'd like to move on with my life, though I can't say this wasn't a valuable experience. Hey Dragon. Yes. The Dragon answered her call. After hearing all of Pandora's deductions, it was impressed and beginning to like this little human. She glanced at the dragon. Can you take us to the entrance? No problem. Thanks. She smiled. A moment later, the dragon wrapped everyone in cocoons of lightning. And in mere moments, they all thundered through the sky. After being dropped by the entrance, they went through it and left the dungeon. The dragon went with them as they appeared outside. With that, they were now able to part ways. Pandora faced the Grand Marshal before she could scurry away. Hey Victoria. What? The Grand Marshal was almost timid in front of the princess, causing Dirk to assume Pandora did something bad. Pandora was all smiles though. When you return, make sure to tell your emperor that the dragons within the dungeons are being sealed by the Sovereign Church. The only other people who could possibly do such a thing large scale are the fairies but I highly doubt they've gone through the trouble. As for the dragon, Pandora turned and craned her neck to see the tall lightning dragon. I don't know. Yuvos. What are your plans? I shall await the order of the primordials, and do as they command. But, my task will likely be assembling an army. Army? Of what? Elementals. Yuvos dipped its head. They are no different from our spawns, beings of pure mana birth from our ever-accumulating power. They shall be the denizens of our armies against the gods. Army. Looks like I need to prepare a lot more. Pandora's brows were furrowed in concern over the future. The dragon's words did not bode well. Sigh. Well, then we should be on our way. I'm long overdue for being in the damned caves of the haven. So long, dragon. Wait a moment. Before they separated, Yuvo stopped them. It turned its head to Dirk, speaking within his mind. I have noticed that you have a deep affinity for lightning. And, the mark of the dark dragon primordial. Dirk silently stared at the dragon who had apparently seen that mark. Then again, Dirk didn't find it that surprising. Waving its hand, a cluster of lightning congealed within the dragon's claws. It condensed with extreme power, shrinking more and more until it became a lightning crystal. 
Yuvos handed it to Dirk. Take it. It is a mana crystal containing comprehensions into lightning itself, something for you to study from. Do not allow your lightning affinity to go to waste. It can be an extremely powerful tool, even if it is auxiliary. And, if you're doing as I suspect with those mana hearts within your body, then you will need comprehensions into lightning in order to advance any further. Be diligent in your studies. Now, I shall take my leave. With that, the dragon retreated to the dungeon. Dirk started fiddling with the lightning crystal as Pandora took out the car. Before they could board and leave though, Ethan caught up with Dirk. Hey! Dirk! Yes? Dirk faced his brother plainly. The two weren't close, having spent nearly no time with each other, but they were still brothers. Even Dirk recognized the inherent trust that was supposed to be present between them, though he would never blindly trust anybody unless they proved themselves. Ethan wasn't sure what to say to this distant brother of his, but he eventually got some words out. If you ever need a place, the military is always open. You don't even have to join. Just know it's a place to fall back on should you need help. All right. Thanks. Dirk nodded before boarding the car with Pandora. Ethan watched him with complicated emotions. They had led such vastly different lives. But what changed everything was when Dirk disappeared for a couple years. While his parents wouldn't tell him the specifics, Ethan had seen how horribly stressed and anguished they were for those couple years. Especially Cecilia. She had saleslessly worked in covert operations for those couple years, showing Ethan a side of her he didn't think was possible. And when he saw Dirk at that city, he could tell. That younger brother of his was no longer there. Dirk may as well have been a stranger he didn't know. Ethan didn't want to be so distant from Dirk. He felt it was regrettable. He felt like the only one Dirk could turn to was his mother and nobody else. But Ethan wanted otherwise. For his entire family, he wanted them to be a strong unit. Especially after overhearing about all these conspiracies involving dragons and gods and various powers. Those who stuck together through trust would survive in this world that had rapidly descended into war. Ethan knew his family was the most reliable group to give that trust to, and he wanted Dirk to be a part of that. But seeing Dirk drive away with the vampire princess, he realized doing that may be more difficult than he imagined. Dirk seemed to be wrapped up in something greater, and he wasn't about to back out. With those thoughts, Ethan watched the car disappear in the distance. And with the urging of the Grand Marshal, he turned around and departed. Chapter 136, General Varmite Next stop, the Haven. It's about damn time. Pandora sighed while speeding down a smooth trade route. After driving from landmark to landmark for nearly three weeks, bypassing a few cities in the process, they were finally getting close to the Dwarven Haven. By now, they had put themselves on a trade route, which meant the roads were smooth. But the terrain was becoming mountainous, meaning the car was having a harder time driving. Still, they were on track to arrive within three more days, which would put them at the three-week mark since leaving. Perhaps unfortunately for Dirk, he had to deal with being sealed in a car with Pandora for three entire weeks. Three weeks of complaining, of mild sexual harassment, and blood-sucking. During all this time, Dirk spent his hours in the back of the car working on his armor. Since he forged all the wire he needed, he just needed to put it together. There was no need to bring out the vault and work on a huge forging table. But in order to keep Pandora on the wheel and let him work, he had to make some concessions. The biggest of which was his blood. Pandora thought his blood was the highest delicacy, so she desired it immensely. But he couldn't be sucked dry, so in exchange for her driving, he had to give her a sip every three days. Or, it started at every three days. After a while it became every two days then every day, but she would take smaller sips. Now, when they went to bed for the night or were ever in close proximity, she was practically gnawing on him. Dirk tolerated it, and two things made it easy to do that. One, his armor continued to come together nicely. While putting holes in scales was still a major pain in the ass, he still managed. With that, it was only a matter of time. 
It only took two weeks to get everything from the neck to the waist finished. After that was the legs, and he was only moving faster than before. He was close to finishing. The second thing that made him excited was progress with muscle destruction. It took greater and greater amounts of rich anima, but thankfully he didn't lack any bones that were filled with it. By now, Dirk's muscle destruction was over 75% finished. He would be able to finish a week or two after arriving at the haven. Many of his muscles were already completely refined, and from them he could feel seemingly unlimited strength. Not only that, but the amount of energy and anima in his body multiplied a few times over as it became more and more saturated. He was definitely much more powerful than before, and he was eager to fight something. Well, after three weeks of driving, he was eager to do anything. He'd been sitting around for too long. Pandora was the same. The only thing she had to keep her occupied was her book of life and Dirk. So they were both looking forward to arriving at the haven. Fortunately, the time came soon. Or, perhaps sooner than they thought. It was a day before they were supposed to reach the haven, when suddenly, they encountered a massive army. Hey, Dirk. H.M. Come look at this. H.M. Dirk hummed, but as he was immersed in building his armor, he didn't actually hear what she said. Turning around with narrowed eyes, Pandora pointed, letting out a gust of frosty air. It froze the back of Dirk's neck, causing him to jump a bit and turn around with a grouchy face. What do you want? You had blood only eight hours ago. I told you to come look at this. I'm starting to think you're developing selective hearing. More like selective ignorance. Now what is it? Dropping the armor and crawling to the front, Dirk looked out the window. Currently they were peeking over one of the many mountains in the area, and in the distance, Dirk could see what he could only guess was a large army. Problem was, that army was right in their way. They seemed to be entrenched in makeshift fortresses. Since it was early in the morning, nothing seemed to be happening. But the encampment was no doubt preparing for battle. The dwarven army? Probably preparing for monsters. That's what I was thinking. Unfortunately for them, I'm not spending another few weeks fighting monsters. We're going there, but we're going to find our way straight to the capital afterward. I might need to talk to whoever is leading this army though. I don't need to drive into a swarm. Whatever gets us out of this car. Dirk sighed before getting comfortable in the passenger seat. Their approach didn't go unnoticed. Even before they arrived, the army had mustered a small force to greet them. Halt! A voice rattled the car from afar, causing it to stop. With that, Dirk and Pandora got out. After Pandora stowed the car in her ring, the two walked over. And seeing as how they weren't monsters, the soldiers lowered their guard. What looked like a captain rode out on a large beast resembling a mole. He greeted the duo with a few attendants. This road has been closed off. Identify yourselves. My name is Pandora Venatis, Royal Princess of the Dark Kingdom. Princess? The captain was shocked. Without another word, Pandora retrieved an item and tossed it. The captain caught what looked like a small medallion. However, the magical aura the medallion emitted along with the intricate design and complex enchantments made him realize Pandora wasn't kidding. I, I see. Please, follow me princess. The two were promptly led into the encampment. They were taken straight to the leader. Along the way, Dirk observed the dwarves. The dwarves were definitely shorter than the average human. However, it seemed like the more powerful dwarves were taller. The captain who led them, for instance, still reached Dirk's shoulder in height. And with those robust muscles, he definitely seemed stronger than Dirk. Perhaps getting more powerful really did make them taller. Their skin also seemed to get darker with more power as the captain had gray skin compared to the others who had bronze skin. And the hair. Dirk was astonished as they finally met the leader of the encampment. It seemed like all the unique aspects of dwarves came together with this man. Taller than Dirk, with steel gray skin and so much hair it could form a wool blanket. It was a good thing Dirk's eyes were covered, because he couldn't hold back his awe. 
As for Pandora, she could act unfazed in any situation. She smiled brightly while shaking the man's hand. He greeted them more enthusiastically than they thought he would. Greetings, princess. I'm thrilled to meet you. In fact, a few of my superiors have been expecting your arrival for a while now. It is likewise a pleasure to make your acquaintance. And their expectations make it easy to follow through with my next steps. Do you perhaps have a way for me to make haste toward your capital? Of course. Please, come with me. I'll have you be on your way soon. The leader led them toward the eastern gate of the encampment. He seemed happy as he did so, not afraid to make conversation. I must say, I'm excited to hear news of your propositions, Princess Pandora. Is that so? Have my discussions reached that many years? Indeed. Your technology is revolutionary. Smiths across the entire haven are amazed by your work. They've been studying it for months. They say it will open up a whole new world of magical engineering. Oh, I happen to be a blacksmith myself, you see. I'm also enamored by your work. The leader scratched his neck as his passion spilled forth. Pandora was all smiles. I thank you for the praise. And I figure that the dwarves, known for their genius in the field of magical engineering, would enjoy the fruit of one of my inspirations. Ha, ah, you know us dwarves well. Indeed, we've gone crazy. In fact, there are many who are trying to replicate your technology. They say it can be used all across the empire, especially for things like mining. Well, they wouldn't be wrong. And if your nobles agree, I would be more than happy to engage in the widespread use of my railways. After all, these days are not like they used to be. Everyone needs all the efficiency they can get when battling these monsters. Truly. The leader nodded solemnly. And with that, they arrived. The east gate was opened, revealing a long trail through the mountains. This was the final stretch toward the capital. With a carriage, it would take no more than six hours to arrive. Do you need a ride? No, thank you. We have our own. Very well. I wish you safe travels. Be wary of stray beasts. Some like to wander away from their generals. Noted. Nodding, Pandora summoned the car, and the duo jumped inside. With that, they left as fast as they came. Pandora was pleased by the smooth passage. However, Dirk was a bit concerned by some of the leader's words. Hey, they say they're trying to replicate your trains. Of course. They're dwarves. And is that not bad for you? If they start building their own, you won't get the economic control you wanted. That's true. You could say that it's a race to see who builds the railways first. And we haven't even finalized the deal yet. Unfortunately, I'm a few dozen steps ahead of them. How so? Pandora looked at Dirk with a victorious smirk. I've already begun building, and my railway is already halfway complete. Even if they began building now, they wouldn't own more than a quarter of the railway, and that much only amounts to what's in their territory anyway. The rest is mine, so in the end, I control it entirely anyway. Plus, only I have the proper train engines. So, you could say they've lost the battle before it even started. Oh. Dirk was a bit amazed. He knew Pandora was building railways throughout her empire and preparing to build towards the haven, but he didn't know it was already halfway done. And her economic opponent didn't know this fact. It was an understatement to say that Pandora's opponent during negotiations wasn't going to have a fun time once they found out. Though, she would only tell them after the deal was completed no doubt. And she would enjoy every second of victory. Even now she was humming to herself in glee, thinking all about how much better she was compared to them. Dirk sighed. It was going to be an interesting trip, at least. Soon, the duo arrived before a pair of utterly massive gates. The entire side of the mountain they were at the base of had its walls replaced with two huge doors, both of which were engraved with countless images and embedded sculptures. It was a work of art unto itself, a mural of all dwarven artistry. It was even encased in metal, making them impossibly heavy. Dirk even recognized the metal. It was geode, 
a metal filled to the brim with earth mana. And naturally, geode was the toughest metal you could get your hands on. Of course, it depended on how pure the geode was, but regardless, those two doors were worth incalculable amounts of money. Not just for the material, but for what they represented. They were one of the icons of the entire dwarven haven. But those two doors were closed. That definitely wasn't normal considering how difficult it was to move them even an inch. They were no doubt closed due to the recent outbreak of war. Thankfully, those two doors weren't the only entrance. To the side there were barricaded entrances that were much smaller and constructed like fortresses. The duo rode up to one of these entrances, and like before, they were forced to jump out and announce themselves. Hearing who it was though, they were quickly ushered in. A general even came to meet them personally. Princess Pandora. I am General Varmite. I have sent word of your arrival. Allow me to accompany you to the Central Palace. Thank you, General Varmite. Of course. And this is. General Varmite looked at Dirk, who was similarly looking back. For a while, Dirk tried to figure something out. Was this General Varmite a male or female? The general's voice wasn't as deep and acoustic as the other dwarves. But his or her stature was just as large and strong, making Dirk unable to immediately figure it out. Plus, with all the luxurious furs and the huge skull on the shoulder of his or her armor, any signs of gender were completely masked. This is Dirk, and he's my consort Dash. Escort. On this trip. Hmm. The general narrowed his or her eyes at Dirk, who continued to stare at them even while correcting Pandora. Eventually, he or she leaned forward. Hey, kid. I'm 16. And I'm 122. But you don't catch me staring at other ladies. Oh. With that, Dirk confirmed his thoughts. It was a girl. General Varmite smirked. Wondering how a female dwarf managed to become a general? It's because I've got more balls than the men and I'm not a brainless fool. Isn't that right? Yes, General. All the nearby dwarves roared in response, causing Pandora to smile. Dirk remained still though, as if he didn't hear any of the rock-shaking roars. It caused the general to smile more. You've got an interesting aura around you, kid. It feels sharp, even for me. But, you're traveling hand in hand with the vampire princess. So I guess it's not too surprising. Not hand in hand. Dirk grumbled in retort, but it only made the general laugh. Ha! Ah. Dense as a star. Isn't that right? Yes, general. Dense as a star. All the dwarves roared again, causing Pandora to laugh herself. He just shook his head. Perhaps if they knew what kind of person Pandora was, they'd all turn tail and run. Anyway, the nobles are waiting for you. And even their politics can bust my balls. So I'd rather not keep those big noses waiting. Come. With a wave, the general ushered them over to a carriage. After stepping inside, it quickly took off. Dirk observed everything from above. The Dwarven Haven. It was the largest single city among all the empires and it was constructed entirely underground within one of the largest mountains in what was dubbed the Geode Mountain Range. And truly, it was a sight to behold. Buildings that were built up to the ceiling, bridges that connected those buildings in the air, and millions of floating lights that made everything seem like a festive party. It was dark yet luminous at the same time. Plus, it was filled with industrial engineering. There were elevators that could travel up the sides of buildings, and surprisingly, even little train cars that rode on railways suspended in the air. For a second, Dirk thought that the dwarves already had train technology. But then he realized the problem. Although the engineering was industrial, there was one key difference that not just these machines, but all technology in this world had from Earth. The power sources were all magical. Whether it was train cars, looms, water boilers, carriages, or any other machine, they were all run by the universal power source, mana crystals. They were the ultimate battery that could be easily obtained by hunting monsters. It was no wonder that dwarves were amazed by Pandora's trains. 
It wasn't because of the railways or trains themselves. They already had that technology. It was the engine that drove the train. A power source that wasn't magical, a vehicle that could run by burning coal or wood and boiling water. It was purely material and made use of cheap substances that dwarves would normally dump away. It was obvious why they were so excited about the tech. It really was revolutionary. Still, Dirk was impressed by them. If given another several decades, perhaps there would be a few people who could make the push toward purely material power sources. That would be the catalyst that would propel the dwarves into the modern era. Imagine if they had computers. Imagine if they could combine such informational technology with magic enchantments. Imagine an earth with magic. It was scary to think about. But, from what Dirk could see, the dwarves were pushing themselves in the right direction. With those thoughts in mind, Dirk and Pandora arrived before the Dwarven Palace. Chapter 137, Cards The welcome wasn't as grand as they thought it would be. The central palace of the Dwarven nobility seemed incredibly busy as dozens of large men ran across the floor and scrambled into elevators. Some directly bound to the top of staircases and continued on their way. Dirk and Pandora naturally wanted to know what was going on, and General Varmite enlightened them. Things have been getting hectic with the recent dungeon outbreaks. What's going on is nothing short of a war against monsters. Thankfully our facilities are underground and easy to defend, not to mention how fortified we naturally are. But no major dungeon should cause you this much turmoil. Don't tell me. Pandora suddenly thought of something, looking toward the general with a concerned gaze. The general nodded. It's the dragon lair. That massive dungeon has been spitting out more monsters than we can count. It's taken just about every armed force we have to defend against it. The front line of the war is centered north of the Haven capital. We'll check out that front line when we're done here. Perhaps we'll be of assistance. I suppose it couldn't hurt. Sure. Just find me. I'll be staying here in the palace. The general happily agreed, much to Pandora's satisfaction. After all, the deal with the railways was only half the reason she was here. She didn't forget her primary objective in this war cataclysma. Before long, the general showed the two to a room. Wait here. I'll go notify the parties involved. Dirk and Pandora entered the room without complaint. As soon as they did, Pandora waved her hand, the Book of Life appearing with a holy glow. Miss Record. I'm here. Like she was her most casual friend, Pandora called upon the system itself. Dirk found it amazing every time. Tell me, is the key artifact of Earth near that front line? Not yet. How interesting. But we can't actually attain control of it, can we? The key artifact should be completely sealed. It is no more powerful than any Tier 4 item. That's not what I mean. Pandora sighed. If that thing sees the light of day, it's going to be a beacon for just about every damn Tier 7 and 8 dwarf in the vicinity. Without getting to it first, we're not going to be able to grab it without anyone knowing. And the dwarves aren't going to let such an amazing artifact go. I wouldn't be surprised if they imprison us and threaten the Vampire Queen. And then the higher powers will get involved and this mission of ours becomes infinitely more difficult. Taking a seat at a table, Pandora's fingers rapidly tapped its glossy surface, making clicking noises in the quiet room. Dirk just let her think. She was supposed to be the great strategist. Then, she suddenly stopped, her red eyes flashing as she glanced at Dirk. Dirk! H.M. If we end up causing a diplomatic incident that involves getting arrested or being declared criminals, then you need to be ready to escape from this city with me. I'm going to give us some time between talking to these nobles and going to the front lines. You're going to take that time to make any preparations you need to. Give us multiple escape routes. What are you planning? Dirk frowned at her, causing her to roll her eyes. Nothing yet but we need to be prepared to do anything to secure that key artifact, nothing short of killing anybody that gets their hands on it. While I have a certain level of political immunity, I'm not willing to wait for my mother to bail me out and pull higher powers into our mission. 
so, it may come down to escaping as fugitives. Just make the preparations. Maybe we won't have to and it'll all end cleanly. But that's highly unlikely. Fine. Dirk sighed before agreeing. Regardless of the situation, if Pandora was going to pull him into a mess, then he wanted a way out. It wasn't long before the duo was called into another room. The meeting room was rather lavish, though this wasn't surprising considering the dwarves. The Dwarven Haven was perhaps the richest of the major empires. They were right between the Horizon Empire and Beast Kin Unity, making them a major trading center. Plus, with how much mining the dwarves did, they were the host of massive material refinement and processing. This compounded with their specialty in crafting, making the haven the best place to get yourself a weapon or set of armor. So when Pandora saw the meeting room that had gold chandeliers and massive marble statues crafted by expert sculptors, she wasn't too surprised. Dirk was, on the other hand. This was just a meeting room, not the king's chambers. Upon arrival, besides the fancy decor, there were also the large dwarves that had already arrived. There were seven dwarves, and Pandora sat at one end of the table with Dirk while the others sat opposing. Welcome, Princess Pandora. We're rather surprised by your arrival here. We had thought our deal might be put on hold when the war broke out considering both of us are dealing with slews of monsters attacking our nations. The dwarf at the head gave his greeting, speaking with a deep and commanding voice. Pandora remained neutral. Her dark kingdom was indeed having a much more difficult time facing the monsters than the haven. Her cities were like horizons that were being invaded by monster armies. While the dwarves were the same, their cities being underground helped immensely. They were a natural fortress. I'm thankful for your concern, King Grayscale, but the Dark Kingdom has since settled any initial chaos since the outbreak. Besides, there is very little that could stop me from carrying out this project with the Haven. After all, it's too lucrative for both of us. And should things go well, I'm prepared to make it even more lucrative for you and your Haven. I can't say we're not interested in what you have in mind. The dwarves beside the king all smiled oddly at Pandora, causing her to give a sweet smile back. As for Dirk, his senses were wholly focused on the dwarf at the head of the table. How could he not have seen it? King Grayscale, the king of the dwarves and the most powerful single entity in the dwarven haven. One of the most powerful people in the world, standing at its topmost height. In Dirk's senses, he couldn't manage to make out any colossal energy source. When Spite had seen Emperor Horizon, he had appeared in her vision as a blinding source of light, not able to be recognized at all. But this king? He released no mana. Dirk could barely sense a light film of earth mana, and that was what the atmospheric mana allowed him to see after it glossed over the king's skin and clothing. Still, even just what Dirk saw was shocking once he focused on it. Chest armor formed of large scales, each of which was filled with the purest compressed metal mana. On his shoulder, the skull of a dragon. On his chest, a dragon heart that had melted into his scale armor. A braided gray beard. And a stature larger than any man Dirk had ever seen. He wasn't a dwarf, but a giant. Even in his seat he towered over everyone present, his arms the thickness of a normal man's torso. To Dirk, he was a confusing mass of power. He could see the man around him that gave a glimpse of how amazingly dense and pure it was. And then there was the dragon heart, one that looked exactly like Yuvos's lightning heart from the dungeon. But, other than superficial senses, Dirk couldn't see the depth of his power. The earth and metal man around him was so dense and rigid that nothing was leaked. To a certain degree, it obscured his figure, making his presence all the more threatening. Dirk wasn't doubting the fact that this man could kill a dragon. Though, he couldn't believe that the king himself was here to attend this meeting with Pandora. Subconsciously, as Pandora began to dive into the discussion, Dirk began checking the exits and searching through his rings for his weapons. He couldn't help but be uncomfortable in front of this king. It almost felt like the king's gaze was on him too. King Grayscale, we can keep the contents of our deal simple. There are dozens of items that can be traded between our empires, and all of it can be facilitated through the railways. 
If we can get an established line between us, then nothing is stopping both nobles and merchants from making trades. That's true, Princess Pandora. But one major contention we must discuss is the ownership of the railway. This ownership will heavily determine the details of the tax laws that are put into effect, as well as determine the fees for simply using the railways. One of the other dwarves, a noble, quickly announced one of the big issues. This was the crux of the matter. Pandora smiled. This is indeed an issue, but I don't believe it can't be resolved easily. I'm ready to give the haven ownership of any railways within your territory. With that, you can tax the goods on the trains as you would any other merchant. Ah, but you see, we have discussed another possible alternative. Yet another dwarf chimed in, barely containing his smile. In order to save you, Pandora, from having to deal with the logistical issues of construction within the haven, we propose that us dwarves handle any and all railway and depot construction within our territory. This naturally means that we wish to stipulate that anything constructed by the dwarves similarly falls under our ownership, including anything outside of our territory. Interesting. Pandora pretended to be surprised by the offer. Some of her smile faded. There's one issue with this. That is, you don't know the specifications for the railway blueprints. And only standard dimensions were given to you for the train engines themselves meaning constructing an efficient train depot would be difficult. We've thought of this problem as well, and in response we want to add the exchange of blueprints for the railways and engines into our deal. The dwarf shamelessly laid out his desires. Normally Pandora would be enraged by such blatant greed, but she only smiled. My, that's a significant offer. And one that I will immediately reject. The technology for the train engine is the literal heart of my operation, something that I won't be handing to anyone anytime soon. You mean to say that it will be a possibility in the future? This time, King Grayscale asked. The technology of the steam engine was seriously major. Not just the king, but many nobles and just about every dwarven engineer realized that the steam engine was a revolutionary technology. They all desperately wanted it. Pandora knew this but she planned to get as much out of it as possible. She wouldn't hand it over for cheap. She smiled. Of course, your highness. I understand that this technology is something that not just the dwarves, but every empire, besides perhaps the elves, will want. So I won't be so greedy as to insist on a monopoly of the tech forever. But this is also something I personally developed. I hope I won't be cheated of this achievement especially by the dwarves who are known for their policies on intellectual property. H.M., I understand your worries, Princess Pandora. The king nodded, and the other dwarves went quiet, the smiles disappearing from their faces. All of the technology within the haven, such as the lights and the magic railways and transportation systems, were all developed by a few dwarven companies. As the dwarves were a race of craftsmen, they naturally valued intellectual property. Things like patents and royalties were not uncommon here, and many patents were for magical tech. If they were to steal Pandora's technology, it would be a major blemish on the haven. All intellectual laws would be thrown into question, and even the dwarven people would riot. No matter how good the tech was, if the government were stealing it, then it would make people mad. It would undoubtedly hurt their economy. So they had to play nice with Pandora. Thankfully, she was also understanding of the value of her engine tech. She bowed toward the king. Thank you, King Grayscale. But worry not. I came here expecting to offer something after much thought, an offer that will solve all your worries. And what might that be? Pandora raised her head, her eyes gleaming. Simple. After six months of trading with each other, I will hand the technology over to you for a price. From then on, you will own all train depots, engines, and railways within your territory to do with and expand as you please. Oh! The dwarves all widened their eyes, surprised that Pandora was willing to make such a deal with them. Even the king was enticed. What's your price? First, I want the haven to subsidize all of my construction costs. Building for your territory or for the purposes of our trade will cost me nothing. And then, at the end of our six-month time period, 
I will hand you the blueprints for forty thousand crystals. Thousand? A dwarf couldn't help but blurt out. Forty thousand crystals. That equated to forty billion silvers. That was no small amount of money, for either a government or a major company. Even the king frowned at that number. That's a significant amount of money. A number that will revolutionize your entire empire, King Grayscale. Because we both know that the engines of these trains can be applied to so much more than just trains. It's mechanized power. At the cost of mere materials like coal, you can achieve the power of thousands of mages. And these machines needn't sleep. To be able to work all hours of the day, that's labor that will put you ahead of all the other empires. These engines will set you on a new path. They will be the catalyst for the greatest technological jump your empire has ever made. All for the price of 40,000 crystals. Pandora couldn't help but relax back into her seat. The one thing she liked about smart people was that they couldn't escape from the reality before them. These dwarven nobles before her absolutely understood the engine's value. So they also wouldn't be able to downplay its importance. Pandora wouldn't let them. Besides, Pandora continued, her tone suddenly falling, and her red eyes sharpening. You must wait the cost of obtaining my technology. I can make certain assurances on my end, ones that will secure your future with this tech. After all, nobody else has this technology. Being one of two sole beneficiaries will be a great advantage for you. But I can also rid you of this advantage. I'm not afraid of the world undergoing another seismic shift after they all discover the power of my tech, and if things go south, I'll make sure that such a shift makes the monster outbreak look like a joke. Princess Pandora Suddenly, the king spoke with his deepest but loudest tone, his voice reverberating across the room. The aura he released was horribly deep, one that made even Dirk's spine run cold. But Pandora faced the king directly. She didn't shy away, her royal disposition carrying her seriousness and arrogance clearly. She was making it known that she was afraid of nobody, and that she held the cards in this game. After a short standoff, the king's aura retracted, grayscale settling his gaze. There is no need for threats here. We are interested in your proposal. We will meet with you tomorrow with an answer and to discuss the details. Of course, your majesty. I'm looking forward to a good response. With that, Pandora stood and curtsied before turning and walking out. Dirk followed right behind her, his steps a bit more stiff. The door closed behind them, and King Grayscale smiled, showing a few silver teeth. Cunning Witch Chapter 138 Exos Could you not antagonize one of the most powerful people in the world? Dirk scolded Pandora as they arrived back in their room. She sat on the bed and smiled. What, and let them think I'm weak? All I did was force them to acknowledge the fact that stealing my tech would come with a greater cost than simply purchasing it. Steal? Dirk frowned, his mind processing all the different ways people could steal Pandora's engine tech. And he surmised that if the dwarves were willing to kill, then it would be incredibly easy to do so. Pandora sighed. Dirk, you underestimate just how freakishly capable magic is. It wouldn't take a skilled forge master more than a week to reverse engineer my engine. So that means it's impossible to hold on to this technology forever if they decide to make a bold move. So in order to get the most out of it, I'm basically selling it instead. Besides, this one-time sale will make me more money than even a couple years of international operation commissions. And they know that. They know that, and you think they'll agree? Well, probably not for the entire 40,000, but most of it. They want the advantage I'm giving them, and if they cheat me, they know I can industrialize the rest of the world as punishment. Just giving the engine tech to the Horizon Empire would negate any advantage they had, let alone if I took it to Unity as well. Pandora twirled her purple hair as if in victory, a broad smile on her face. And Dirk couldn't help but nod slowly. Forge masters weren't stupid, so unless every engine was covered and locked with intricate enchantments, there would be nothing stopping even Dirk from getting a read on its entire design with mana. After that, just a bit of general study would let them know everything about the engine. In fact, as he thought about it more, 
Dirk realized that it was almost too easy to steal the engine tech. In that case, selling it was the correct choice. Pandora waved. Anyway, you're no longer needed here. Go ahead and prepare our escape routes. Tomorrow I'll negotiate and finalize the deal. Then we're off to the front lines. Hmm. Dirk frowned at her. Since when do you just shoo me off like a dog? Sorry? Whatever. I'll deal with preparing our escape route later. Saying that, Dirk walked over to the door, leaving with a huff. Pandora tilted her head, staring at the closed door for a while. Sorry. Dirk made his way into the city. Streets of stone and buildings of metal. He saw things that he had only seen back on Earth, and some things he hadn't. The train cars that rode through the air on suspended rails, and buildings that touched the ceiling of the mountain. Along with all the many thousands of floating lights that gave this underground cave artificial daylight, the haven was quite magical. But it was also overwhelming for him. That was because, in the event that Pandora went and pissed off the wrong person, he'd need to escape this place. It was a fortress bigger than any city. Dirk was thinking that hiding within the city would actually be better than escaping it, but he knew that people at certain power levels could find them anyway they would never be able to escape King Grayscale. So that meant they would have to leave, but as far as Dirk was concerned there were only a few exits out of this place. First, the main doors. They were closed, but there were still smaller openings to their sides. But even those were heavily locked down and overseen by a general, who was on the same level as a duke and a proper tier 8. If they got anywhere near such a being, it would be no different than facing the king himself. Thinking that far, this place was no different than a prison. Dirk already felt uncomfortable, and Pandora's previous warnings didn't help. Why am I even doing this? As he walked amongst many small people, he couldn't help but let out a long sigh. He began to recall his time at the Dark Kingdom. Everything had happened so quickly. One day, he was still just the child of a Marquis making promises with his mother to go hunting and looking forward to possibly going back to the academy in order to top up on some magical education. He was even thinking about how much he wanted to go and join Alec on whatever vigilante work he did. Dirk had heard several things about what he did while he had disappeared. But then, Pandora showed up. He was roped in, made a pact with the last person he ever thought he would, and became the center of attention in regard to her war effort but that lasted all of a few hours. The arrival of the Dark Dragon Primordial that heralded global change and catastrophe was what really flipped everything upside down. And if Pandora's speculations were true, then it was Emperor Horizon who used Dirk as the trigger for that event. And with the mission from the system itself. Too many cataclysmic events happen way too fast. And Dirk wasn't sure about how he felt being in the center of it all. He knew Pandora was both the magnet and the source of all chaos, but this was too much. Now he was planning an escape route in case they had to run from the dwarven nobility. And of course, nobles weren't some snobby, fat pigs like in medieval times. No, they were atrociously powerful warriors and mages who could flip cities upside down given a bit of effort. Every one of them was someone to fear. And it wasn't that Dirk feared them. Instead, he simply understood the disparity of power. In this place, his survival was the furthest thing from guaranteed. On all sides were enemies he couldn't fight. He had been made too aware of how utterly powerless even he could be in the face of true power. It was irritating, like a gun constantly pressed against his head. Why was he doing all this? Why did he have to deal with Pandora and all her crazy schemes, bearing all the potential danger that she would inevitably lead him into? Dirk suddenly stopped walking, looking around him. To both sides there were large buildings, the walls of which were totally open and showing the inside where one could see dwarves working on all sorts of crafts. There were booths that some dwarven girls sold crafts from, obviously working for the forge masters within the buildings. And there were many other races here too. Dirk could see elves walking through the place, many grumbling about the stifling concentration of the city. Most of them had long hair, and of course the signature long ears that stuck out from between the layers of hair. In the hybrids. 
ones that looked like tigers, wolves, lions, even birds and reptiles. There were all kinds of hybrids that wore thick sets of armor and carried all manner of weaponry. Humans were abundant too, as were vampires. All races gathered in this city in order to get some of the most powerful and abundant dwarven weaponry and gear. This was the industrial paradise of the world, a place that could arm entire armies with ease. And no product was crummy. The dwarves took pride in their craft, so nothing shabby would be sold except by the few swindlers who worked in the dark areas of the city. But the place Dirk arrived in was near the center, no doubt a bustling district of trade and production. And he saw many powerful people. Tier fives walked around like they were common. The amount of people that could threaten Dirk's life was staggeringly high. And it reminded him of why he was going through all this danger. Why he was putting himself at risk. He remembered Pandora's words. Control. I should be able to kill everyone here. His mana vision focused on several people at once. He watched them, finding weaknesses in their movements, gauging their strengths, their talents, and formulating avenues of attack. Such thoughts were more than habit by now. Except before those at the top of the world, he always had plans in his mind to kill everyone he laid eyes on. It was second nature. And he couldn't stand not being able to do as he might need to. You there. With the blindfold. His thoughts were suddenly cut off as a voice reached his ears. Dirk could see the kid who was pointing to him. He was a dwarf, so he was shorter than normal. What was rather odd about this dwarven boy though was the fact that he was skinner than normal dwarves. Even the young teens had bodies with layers of muscle on them. But this kid was obviously thinner, though his height still reached Dirk's shoulder. The bigger question though was why he was calling him. Probably trying to sell something. Dirk turned his head with a sigh. I'm not Dash. Your eyes are hurt, right? I can fix them. Dirk went silent. Considering his eyes were cursed by a tier 8 dark magician, those were bold words. But Dirk was still curious. You can. How? Human boy, don't fall for that brat's tricks. He's nothing but a freak. He, yeah. Just save yourself the time and come over here. Shut up. Just as nearby dwarves began to berate him, the kid snarled and shouted at them. It drew attention but the surroundings were so loud with chatter that nobody really cared. Dirk ignored the others, focusing on the boy. How can you fix my eyes? Simple. I'll build you new ones. I call them augmentations, and they're body parts made with magic materials and the power of machines. If you're interested, I'll take a look and see if I can't fit you for an augmentation right now. Ugh, disgusting. Crazy bastard. Other dwarves, and even nearby elves and hybrids began to cringe at the kid's words. And they truly were quite outlandish. After all, Dirk was very familiar with augmentations. He knew them as cybernetic enhancements. Even on Earth these cybernetics weren't super popular, and that's when you could get an arm installed that would allow you to warp steel with your fingers. To actually advertise magical body augmentations in this world people probably thought this kid was a madman. But it made Dirk even more curious. What's your name? Dirk asked, and the dwarf barely held back a smile. My name is Exos Havilite. This is my workshop. Please don't touch anything. Dirk was led into a warehouse, though it wasn't as big as the ones he saw on the main street. Still, it was kept shockingly tidy. Everything was aligned in specific ways and all random tools were organized precisely and on benches. The floors were sparkly clean, even the ceiling, and all the machines Dirk saw were pristine. More than that, he seemed to have a chemistry lab, or in this world it would be an alchemy lab. There were all kind of fluids, and he even had cages with various animals in them. Amazingly, some of them had metal limbs, like a reptile that had a metal arm with enchanted lines all over it or a bird with a metal wing. And they all worked. Dirk couldn't help but look at Exos again. He's a freaking scientist. An actual genius. First, let me explain my craft. I want you to know that my augmentations actually work. 
Dirk watched the kid approach a desk and turn around. My augmentations work by connecting enchanted devices to your bodily systems. The only prerequisite is that you have to be a mage, but even that requirement is slowly going away with my work. Those animals in those cages are proof that some augmentations don't require any active magical input to work. Though, in order to power the augmentations long term, you still need to have a mana source which comes in the form of mana crystals. Exos stood straight, almost like a noble giving a lecture. And, same as the warehouse, Exos was very well kept. Sharp clothes, white gloves, and a prim appearance. He was the spitting image of perfection. Nothing was out of place on his body. It was probably an OCD thing. Thankfully, you fit my requirements perfectly. Therefore, given some time, I can construct augmentations for you. Is it legal? Dirk suddenly asked, causing Exos to nod. It is. Or, it's more precise to say that it's not illegal. There are no laws about augmentation, however, I will need to have you sign a few magical contracts if you choose to get this work done. Naturally, I will also make you fully aware of everything I'm going to do. But, rest assured, your new eyes will give you what you don't have. Interesting. Dirk couldn't help a smile. Then, Exos reached for his glove. He took it off, revealing a metal hand. As more proof, you can see that I've actually augmented myself. My entire left arm is constructed of geode, and inside are hundreds of small components that make it stronger than any normal arm. Not even a rank 4 could compare to the strength of this arm, and I don't train anima. He pulled up his sleeve as he spoke, showing more and more of the metal arm. Dirk could see in between some of the joints, observing various plates and only a few gears that were exposed. Not only that, but there were hundreds of tiny enchanted lines as well. He could see earth mana pumping through the arm as if they were veins, and this seemed to give it strength. In that way, his magical strength could directly translate to physical strength. Along with my left arm, I've also augmented my right leg, managing to merge enchanted devices with my flesh and blood. The result is armored skin as well as the ability to contain a weapon, though it's still mostly my original body. You did it to yourself? For the most part. I've only received some help from alchemists in order to concoct some important potions that allow this process to be carried out and forge masters to construct the physical components. But I do all the enchanting by myself, which is the most important part and what allows my products to do what they do. Dirk was shocked. This kid really was something else. Chapter 139, Symbol of Strength Exos did a bit more advertising, showing off the details of his augmentations. He was obviously very eager to make Dirk understand the technology and how capable it was. And perhaps it was more than just trying to attain a customer, instead proving to someone else that this was a valid technology. Exos even spoke about all the backlash he received from his family and other nobles. How his own father basically exiled him from their home, and how he was constantly degraded by those around him. Now, he was relying on the funds he had saved since he was a child to fuel his projects, though even that was dwindling. It seemed like at every corner, he was faced with adversity and troubles that hampered his dream. Dirk was likely the first person to truly hear him out. Unfortunately, Dirk wasn't listening to him except to satisfy his own curiosity. Not in a million years did he believe that this kid was able to give him a new set of eyes to bypass Azura's curse. So. What do you think? After what seemed like a lecture, Exos caught himself and stopped talking, asking Dirk's opinion. Dirk nodded. He already knew just about everything there was to know about augmentations, or as he knew them, cybernetics. What you're doing here is revolutionary. You're nothing short of a genius. Oh, ah, uh, thanks. Exos couldn't help the smile, even though he tried to look as professional as possible. Dirk looked around, seeing all the fruits of his hard work. Exos was no doubt completely obsessed with this work, and it was indeed a worthy thing to obsess over. Technology like this could change the world just as much as Pandora's modern knowledge. In fact, it gave Dirk a few ideas. Someone like Exos shouldn't just be left here to waste away with no money. Instead, he needed to be nurtured. Dirk asked. 
How old are you? This year I'm 26 years old. Oh. Dirk was surprised. Exos was older than he expected, at least a decade older than his own physical age. Exos could see Dirk's surprise, and it made him sigh. I'm a cripple by dwarven standards. I didn't develop normally, and my two limbs that are now augmentations used to be dysfunctional and disfigured. This crippled nature of mine led me on this path. The path of unifying the body, magic, and metal, to create something greater than anything mere flesh can grow. Dirk was surprised by his grand words. His dream was beyond ordinary, his philosophy extreme. He was willing to take off his own limbs and replace them to pursue his goal. And for the first time, Dirk saw in him what he had only ever seen in the eyes of Pandora. That hint of madness. The fire that pushed someone to seek out the furthest extremities of their ideals. The obsession that would only go unfulfilled if they died. But, was it madness? Or was this just the inner brilliance within Exos? He was an unseen prodigy, but that glint in his eyes reminded him too much of Pandora. Then, perhaps it wasn't necessarily madness. Perhaps that's just what people who sought the highest heights looked like. Maybe that glint was required to do what they did. Anything less, and they wouldn't be able to endure the colossal burden of being the best. Is that what Dirk needed in order to become the best? To become so strong that nobody in the world would be able to threaten his life? Did he need to be more than just a machine that merely ascended step by step? It made him delve into thought. Excuse me? Dirk was brought back to reality only when Exos called. Dirk lifted his head before letting out a breath. I won't be buying any eyes from you. You see, mine are cursed. I can only say that my circumstances are special. Oh. Exos lowered his tone as Dirk squashed his hopes of finally getting a customer. But I want to introduce you to somebody. I believe in your work, but there's also a lot you can improve. I know someone who can greatly accelerate your research. They also have money. Really? Exos asked with both hope and skepticism. Dirk could only reassure him. I guess you could say I work with her. We're here on business. Anyway, she holds knowledge far beyond what you can learn even here at the Haven. Knowledge about mechanics and biology, how machines work and all the components that comprise the body. If you want to reach your goal, then you'll need to meet her. Why are you so willing to help me? Hearing Dirk's generous words, Exos became even more skeptical. Unfortunately, Dirk didn't know what to do about that. He could only say what he wanted to. I just see your potential. Either way, I'm offering this to you. I'll come by in two days to introduce you. Dirk waved while exiting the warehouse, leaving Exos to his thoughts. It was all so sudden, but Dirk really did believe that Exos was a genius worth supporting. Pandora would surely realize it too. The thought of Pandora though made Dirk sigh as he walked through the city toward the gates. Everything revolves around her. Not that I mind, but I feel like I'm not doing anything for myself. I should train tonight. And maybe find a place to work on my armor. He mumbled while observing all the paths he traveled, checking the alleyways, and plotting for the future. He needed to prepare just in case Pandora really did do something crazy and turn the entire haven against them. Dirk spent the rest of that day plotting escape routes through the city. While he was doing this, he operated under the assumption that he was being monitored. And thankfully, with his mana vision he could get away with a lot more than normal. He learned that many buildings were armed with magical locks and magical arms by seeing enchanted clusters on doors or walls. And when he visited the outer reaches of the city near the gates, he was able to plot guard patrol routes with spite and get a layout of the buildings. While more scouting exposed more avenues for escape, it also told Dirk just how difficult it was to go in or out of the city. It really was a massive fortress. But no fortress was impregnable. Another thing Dirk did was let out mana pulses to get a view of the ground underneath his feet. Dwarves were miners, basically a society of moles. And that meant there would be a great many tunnels. And sure enough, merely thirty meters below the surface, Dirk was able to see three or four tunnels in any given area of the city. 
they all connected to the basements of various buildings, and many went so deep that he couldn't see their ends. Those would be a prime route for escape, so long as he could scout them. So since Pandora was giving him a few days to do just that, he planned on utilizing his stealth and going to work. The next day, Dirk didn't see any of Pandora since she was busy with negotiations. So he got straight to work. With stealth, he could evade the senses of anybody even a tier above him. So long as he didn't get in their face, he would be safe. So he chose a few buildings without magic locks and went into their basements, looking for tunnels. With that, he not only scouted various routes that took him to different places within the city, but also dug his own tunnels. In the end, he found and created eight different routes for escape that all led to either the edge near the city gates, down into some mine shafts he discovered, or up into the side of the mountain the city was built within. As Dirk had spite, there was no need for markings that could give things away. She plotted all the routes and precisely captured the look of every surface to make sure that, when he came back through them, they weren't tampered with or compromised. Like that, another day passed. Come the next day, Dirk planned on going back through his routes and perhaps establishing some more. He also needed to go and get the car from Pandora and hide all their pocket rings somewhere. But in the morning, Dirk was pleasantly though unexpectedly woken up by a beautiful girl. Not that he ever fell for her looks. Good morning. Pandora entered the room with a bright smile. More oddly though, she was carrying a platter of food. Just as Dirk started to climb out of his sheets, she spoke with a stern tone. No no, stay there. Why? Because I personally cooked this breakfast for you, and you're going to enjoy it in the comfort of your bed. She said that while placing the platter on his lap. The wooden tray was warm, as was the food on it. And there weren't just dishes from this world, but from Earth as well, recipes that nobody else would know how to cook. She really did make it herself, but that made Dirk skeptical. What did you do? I did nothing except successfully negotiate a deal with King Grayscale. Now, I'm going to acquire around 32,000 crystals within the next three months, as well as a commission deal for trade between our empires and a massive construction order. Dirk was surprised. Although the terms of the deal had changed a bit, it seemed like Pandora still got the most out of everything. She looked exceptionally happy. He turned to the food on the tray, slowly picking up an exotic fruit loaded with tons of anima. When he bit into it, his teeth felt like they were breaking past leather before sinking into soft goodness. The texture was weird, but the taste was heavenly. And when it hit his stomach, it made his body feel vigorous. In fact, as he finished the fruit, he felt something within him reach a threshold. That's when he remembered. I'm about to complete muscle destruction. He had been working on it for weeks, and during the car ride with Pandora he did nothing but focus on his armor and training. And he had gone through a shocking amount of resources. The large reserve of anima bones he used was bitten into a significant amount, especially toward the latter portion when he would use multiple sets of bones to complete one destruction cycle. But now, it was all reaching that tipping point. He could feel all the muscles through his body surge with power. If he wanted, he could grab a few anima bones right now and complete muscle destruction. But he waited. Pandora stood to the side, watching him with a smile on her face. She often blatantly watched him like this, so he wasn't that bothered. He dug into his breakfast, enjoying the well-crafted taste of the nostalgic food. At the same time, he wondered why Pandora went and did this for him. He couldn't think of anything she could have possibly done wrong though that might warrant a cute apology breakfast like this. The only thing he could think of, regardless of how improbable, was that she was doing this out of the kindness of her own heart. He focused on her occasionally in his man of vision while eating his food. Since she was being nice like this. Hey. Mm. She tilted her head at his call. I met a kid a day ago. His name was Exos. 26 years old and I believe he was already a tier 5. He showed me some interesting magic tech. Like? He called them augmentations, but they were basically magical prosthetics. Metal limbs, flesh mods, even sensory organs. 
the kid pioneered what could be considered this world's cybernetic tech. He's a genius, one I think you might like to know about. If all that's true, then I need to see him and his work for myself. He could become an extremely important artisan. You know where he is? Pandora asked, her curiosity piqued. Her mind was already swirling with all the applications for such magical augmentations. He's in some crafting district a mile or so away from here. I told him I'd meet him again today around noon. Then I'll go with you. Stick around for a while and I'll find you when I'm done with the last of my business with these nobles. All right. Dirk nodded while finishing off his breakfast. Before leaving, Pandora walked over to his bedside, reaching over and running her nails through his hair. After straightening it out, she smiled before walking to the door. I know you're close to advancing in rank. I'll leave you be to focus. Thanks. Dirk's voice came out with a hint of confusion. When Pandora walked out and closed the door, he scratched his cheek. Odd. You technically needed a few more days, but it seems things moved a bit faster than planned. Your anima has reached the threshold. I can feel your soul getting ready. Spite paced around while eyeing Dirk. He sat in his room with several anima bones around him, as if he were going to perform some dark ritual. And in his mind, he was reading through the traced runes of his anima resonance destruction technique. He had learned the advanced anima resonance technique that utilized the external anima of high concentration sources, and from now on, he would have to use sources that only got more and more dense with anima. Progressing would be no different from forging his body with gold. It would be a money pit. Thankfully he had a rather large money bag willing to invest in him. Anyway. Dirk's soul had transformed upon finishing blood destruction. It had gained blood vessels of its own, and as a result Dirk earned the ability to expel his anima in the form of aura. Through honing his skills, he had sharpened his aura and became a rook-class warrior capable of utilizing aura alongside weapons. This ability was what allowed him to cut the lightning snake skin for his armor. What would happen once he finished muscle destruction? Dirk had already felt the effects of muscle destruction. He was far stronger, quicker, and more durable than before. The layer of muscles on the body served as not just the source of power behind movement, but also a thick buffer for impact. Unfortunately, Dirk had yet to test these powers of his since he had spent most of his recent time in a car. But even then, his blood destruction didn't explode with its powers and perks until he finished. It would be the same with muscle destruction. Dirk was excited. With the anima bones around him, he began to draw on each one. The anima from them rose up like a white fog, streaming into his body. The last muscle Dirk had been working on were his neck muscles. He had thoroughly destroyed everything else, from his feet, to the tendons in his knees, to his pelvic muscles, and onward through his upper body and arms. And as he streamed the anima as dense as a fog into his neck, it seemed to not just resonate with the muscles, but his entire body. The anima destroyed only a tiny few portions of the muscles in his neck, barely even a tingle. It was more like a purification, purging any unenhanced muscles and finalizing the tempering. That's when Dirk felt it. The anima throughout his entire body, which had been brought up to another level, began to fluctuate like vibrating air. It made his muscles and body twitch. The twitching was so strong that it stressed his bones, threatening to break them. The only thing that kept them from doing so was the dense anima that pervaded his body and indirectly forged his bones stronger. Not only that, but the flexing of his muscles sucked the energy out of him. It was like a black hole for energy, and if Dirk didn't have his blood that was enhanced by blood destruction, he wouldn't be able to fuel his body. This was the reason that destroying the vascular system came only after skin destruction. It would act as fuel for everything else. And so Dirk didn't get deathly tired when his muscles started tightening uncontrollably. They just continued to flex and cramp. He felt like they were trying to squeeze themselves smaller. Dirk grunted because of how uncomfortable it felt. It felt like he was trying to snap his own bones, and his organs felt like they were being constricted. And his body drew an anima as it wished, absorbing it through his skin in vast quantities. 
Victor quickly took out several more anima bones from a pocket ring, allowing it to completely fuel this change. And then, his soul fluctuated along with his body. His awareness moved into that mana dimension. He could see the black dragon coiled around him, as well as Eldritch in the great deep of the dark element. His soul writhed within the dragon's protection. It twitched just like his body did. And then, he could see it. The layer of muscle that appeared within his soul. The symbol of strength. During the changes, Dirk heard the dark dragon whisper. So you forged your body to another level? Keep doing so. It shall be just as important as filling your soul with the power of mana. Those who believe that forging the fleshly body is useless, know nothing about the secrets of the soul and the realm of existence. But you must continue down both paths. Even as Dirk felt his body and soul contracting and crushing itself, he could see the dark dragon open its eyes and gaze at him. Forge your body no longer. Only when you enter the realm of fusion, the next step of mana cultivation, can you begin again. Forsake my advice, and you will forsake the opportunity to ascend to the realm you wish to most. The dragon gave this rare and most precious advice with a serious gaze. Then, it went back to seemingly sleeping. That's when the changes ended. The muscles in his soul, the symbol of strength, finished forming. And the muscles in his body, which had compressed and reformed, took on their new shape. His soul calmed, no longer resonating with the anima. But, that resonation had left a permanent mark. Attention, skill acquisition successful. Dirk Strider has gained the skill, Anima Resonance, Grade 5. The trait, Adaptable Genes has activated in response to physical alterations. The skill, Restoration, Grade 5, has evolved to, Reformation, Grade 6. The skill, Anima Resonance, Grade 5, has evolved to, Anima Oscillation, Grade 6. Dirk smiled at the system's notifications. And then, looking ahead of him, he swung his fist out with the exploding power of his muscles. The anima through his body flowed along his arm as naturally as flowing water. Then, it took on its own frequency as it was released. It warped the air in front of him until the released anima slammed into the wall five meters away, cratering. Cracks went up the hard stone that had been enchanted alongside the rest of this royal palace. Chapter 140, Generals Dirk led Pandora to the place he found Exos. The two entered the warehouse, and sure enough, the dwarf was there. Surrounding him were all his various works and test subjects that proved his ideas. Pandora observed these as she approached. And likewise, Exos observed Pandora. It was hard to tell if he was nervous, but he stood there as stiff as a statue. Exos? My name is Pandora. A pleasure to meet you. Pandora introduced herself, but that seemed to strike a nerve with Exos as his smile froze. Wait, the Pandora? The one who created the train engine. Weren't you in talks with the nobility? I was, but those have ended. You'll be the first to know that our deal has been finalized. But besides that, you seem to know a lot. And my father is Marquis Havilite. You're a noble kid? Dirk blurted out in surprise. Exos had told him that he was kicked out from his household, but he hadn't said it was the household of a Marquis. Exos nodded. My father, being as rich as he is, was the only reason I had enough money for my projects. Gathering magic crystals, hiring enchanters and forge masters, and buying materials isn't cheap. I have a total of six working products, and merely those have eaten away at my funds. Truly amazing. Pandora mumbled as she walked over and saw one of the animals in a cage with a replaced limb. Shockingly, she even took out her book of life while observing it. She walked around for a while, checking out the liquids and papers with designs all over them. And when she came back to Exos, she grabbed his arm and raised it. You've replaced your arm and leg? Why yes. I was a cripple, something that inspired me on this path in the first place, and also one of the reasons I was basically disowned. Dwarves don't like those who aren't strong, and especially not those who are weak runts. Mmm, I've heard something like that about dwarves. Pandora dropped Exo's arm while smiling. 
Like that, she stared into his eyes, and Dirk could see him rapidly turn to putty. He was usually so prim and proper, but now he fidgeted with flushed face. Dirk sighed, and that seemed to catch Pandora's attention as she turned away from the young scientist. Well Exos, you're surely ahead of your time. I understand what Dirk was talking to me about. So I have an idea. She strolled over and picked up a few sheets of paper on a nearby desk. Come with me back to the Dark Kingdom. There, I'm going to personally sponsor your work. You'll run experiments and figure out how to produce standardized products. We can support you with the best facilities and assistance. You'll be allowed to thrive without the naive derision of those around you. She spoke sweet words of success, and Exos was taking them as expected. Now his flushed face was full of excitement and hope. But she wasn't done. And, I personally know about technology that can change the way you work, advanced techniques that can bring your expertise to another level. If you become a craftsman under my wing, I'll give you this knowledge. Dirk, show him the machine gun. Seriously? Dirk was confused at Pandora's command. Although he saw the potential of Exos, he didn't think that exposing the unique technology of Earth was such a smart idea. She smiled. Don't worry. It's not like he can copy the engineering. And you don't need to fire it. I just want to show him. Fine. Strip it too. Dirk let out a breath before waving his hand. Then, a 50 caliber machine gun appeared in his arms. He placed it on a table while dropping the bipod. Then, his hands went to work with familiar reflexes. He flipped open the receiver before pushing tabs and disassembling all the myriads of components that were precisely interconnected. Exos watched with bulging eyes. This is a firearm, an intricate tool built for the purpose of launching small projectiles at supersonic speeds. It uses no magic at all, strictly based in the physics of science and the complexities of chemistry. With just dust and metal, this machine unleashes devastation at 750 rounds per minute. Click. Having stripped it and put everything back together, Dirk closed the hatch with Pandora's last word. Just from seeing its complexity, Exos knew that this wasn't some trick. Nobody would go through the trouble of making something so impossibly intricate and purpose-driven without it hanging a function. Obviously the knowledge that went into constructing it wasn't ordinary in the least. And now, Exos desperately wished he could see that machine be put into action to understand just what she was talking about. He looked at Pandora with shining eyes. I'm willing to go with you. A smart choice. You have extraordinary talent, Exos. I'll make sure you won't be one of the many poor geniuses who waste away because the people around them can't see the hidden gem that lies within you. Thank you, Princess Pandora. Truly. Exos went down on one knee, as if swearing his fealty. And Pandora smiled in content, patting his shoulder only after several seconds. Rise. In the coming days Dirk and I will be moving to the front lines for some business of ours. You'll follow us. That means you have today and tomorrow to pack everything you own. She tossed a pocket ring to him as she said that, which contained several hundred square meters worth of space. Anything you can't pack can be left here, and we'll transport it back later. After all, the railway deal is now in effect. Your items here can be one of the first batches of supplies to be moved across it. Of course. I'll start packing right away. When you're done, use this seal to find me in the central palace. Until then. She handed him a seal with the mark of vampire royalty. And then, she and Dirk left, the excited dwarf wasting no second in preparing himself. Over the next day and a half, Dirk continued to check their escape routes and finalize preparations. Exos also settled in the central palace, having fully committed to his decision. While it had been a golden opportunity that fell out of the sky, he didn't want to make the mistake of doubting it and throwing the chance away. If he let his suspicions keep him from taking the risk, he would never get anywhere in life. Plus, there wasn't much of a way to fake being the princess of the Dark Kingdom. Pandora was trustworthy purely because of her title. Plus, he knew he had valuable intelligence, and she seemed to see it. 
Exos would do everything he could to advance the field that he was pioneering. He would stop at nothing to ensure that it was revolutionary. But none of that would start until they returned to the Dark Kingdom. In the meantime, Pandora made plans to go to the front lines of the Haven's battle with the monster hordes. According to some intelligence she received from the generous General Varmite, there were constant hordes of monsters being spewed out of the dragon lair of Earth that was located only a couple dozen miles away from the Haven. An entire city which had been founded right outside of that lair had been long since annihilated, and now its ruins were the site of a bloody battlefield. The only way such a large-scale and constant battle could be sustained was because those endless monster armies were now an incalculable source of income for the Haven. All the materials and mana crystals from every one of the tens of thousands of beasts were used in whatever way they could. There was no shortage of demand for monster parts since the dwarves were a race of artisans anyway. But it was still incredibly dangerous. Over the past few months, it had served as a trial by fire, a place that now forged the fiercest dwarven warriors. Even the magic academies within the Haven used the place as a live fire training ground where nothing was off limits. Because after all, all the lesser dungeons had disappeared. Only the major dungeons remained, and all the weaker monsters were released around said dungeons. There was no safe way to train mages and warriors anymore. When the day finally came to leave for that very place, Pandora and Dirk grabbed Exos and headed out along with a fresh batch of recruits who would be stationed at the front lines. General Varmite was with them as a temporary escort. And before long, they arrived. The location was a natural barrier not far from the ruined Dwarven city, a choke point created by the meeting of two mountain bases that served as the exclusive road to the ruined city. This was where a new fortress was erected in order to hold back the monster hordes. They called it the Rusted Bastion, a name given to it after the steel of the wall was blessed by the blood of its enemies and dried into a thick rust-colored layer. It was said that this rust made the wall stronger since the blood of monsters carried mana and filled the enchanted wall with power. Dirk, Pandora, and Exos were escorted to the fortress with General Varmite. Dirk scanned the whole place as they entered. It really was a menacing steel fortress. The gap between the two mountain bases wasn't small. It was approximately 1.5 miles wide, and across that entire gap, the dwarves had built a steel wall about 50 meters tall and 130 meters thick. The bulk of the fortress was built within the massive wall, but there were three distinct castle-like structures in the center and out toward the ends. The center structure was where they entered from as they arrived but even from behind the wall, Dirk could clearly see and feel the massive battles ongoing in front. The scale of this war was incomparable to that at the city he had saved. Remember. General Varmite announced solemnly to everyone before entering. In this place, even Tier 7 monsters aren't rare. If you find yourself in a bad situation, it's already too late. To survive here, you must be able to adapt on the fly. Even in the heat of battle, you must maintain total awareness of your surroundings. If you get caught up in the small battles, you will get swept away by the movement of the legions around you. And you'll return as nothing more than a number on a weekly report. Do you understand? Yes, General. All the recruits straightened their backs and saluted. But Dirk, like General Varmite, knew that none of them truly understood the depth of those words. Not until they experienced it firsthand would they realize how easily one could get swept away in a battlefield such as this. Everyone entered the castle, and from there the recruits were handed off to several officers already awaiting their arrival. And with that, General Varmite escorted the remaining three to the command center. The central castle was the headquarters of the entire fortress. Here, there was actually a Tier 8 and a Rank 8 general stationed. Two pillars of the Darvin Haven, two of the most powerful people in the world, stationed at this one fortress to hold back the monsters. Their names were General Feller and General Yumangit. General Varmite, glad you could visit us. The two generals were both men who carried a similar disposition. They were tall dwarves standing at nearly eight feet tall and with giant muscular bodies that bulged even from beneath their full plate armor. One carried a massive mace on his back, no doubt the rank 8, and the other carried a large grey crystal staff composed of the magic metal geode, the tier 8. 
Dirk was a bit overwhelmed by their height. They were even taller than King Grayscale. It seemed dwarves really did get taller with more power. And their skin was a hard steel gray, one that looked sheen and impenetrable. Along with their atrocious strength, Dirk found it difficult to remain standing in front of them. His neck tingled. But their presence wasn't as horrible as King Grayscale. Obviously there was a key difference between them, one that made the king significantly more powerful than they. General Varmite shook the general's hands before introducing Pandora. General Umangit, the Tier 8, rubbed his bristled beard. Ah, it's the princess. I've heard that you officially made a deal with Grayscale. I have, General. And I have plans to make a railway to this fortress my first priority. Trust me when I say that an effective transportation system from here to the capital will make your lives far easier. I believe it. You have my favor. The general nodded with a wide smile, obviously happy. The transportation of supplies and troops, while not strained, definitely brought difficulty on the maintenance of this fortress. But a railway would solve nearly all their issues. They could haul all their monster corpses with ease, free up more manpower, and develop a steady cycle of troops to keep the guards here fresh. It would secure the future of this entire stronghold. The general naturally liked Pandora's priorities, even if only because it eliminated much of the work he had to deal with. At that moment, Pandora glanced to the general's side. She saw General Feller, the rank eight with a massive mace, staring at Dirk. It almost seemed like the two were about to rip each other's throats out with how palpable the aura between them was. Even General Varmite couldn't help but watch curiously. General Feller narrowed his eyes. You're a curious one, aren't you? Trying to kill me with those cursed eyes of yours? Mph, I'd say you're puny with how small you are, but my gut says otherwise. Come, show me what makes you so sharp. General Feller. Just as the general drew his mace, Pandora shouted. The general stopped, but he didn't take his eyes off Dirk, who continued to stand there with statue-like stillness as if he didn't even notice the threat. Please refrain from fighting my consort. He's only recently broken through to rank 5. Is there any way he could possibly threaten you? The general was silent for a moment before putting away his mace. Pandora smiled. Thank you. I'd like to get a look at the wall. General Varmite, do you mind escorting us there? After that we can find our quarters. I expect to stay here for some time. Sure. General Varmite slowly nodded before taking the three away. General Feller watched Dirk as he left. When the door to the command center finally closed, General Feller huffed and turned. General Umangit smiled. You felt it too? I don't like it. That boy is too sharp. And he's a human, no less. Hmm. I actually felt my neck tingle. If he grows up properly, there's no telling how powerful he'll get. I want to know who he is. General Feller scowled. Contact one of our men in the Horizon Empire, and find out which monster birthed such a terrifying boy. Really? Well, if you're that curious. I have a friend at the academy there, a forge master. Surely such a talented human went through that academy. Maybe he knows something. I'll contact him tonight. Do so. With that, General Feller left, leaving General Umangit to chortle. Chapter 141, Contingency General Varmite took Dirk, Pandora, and Exos on a tour of the Wall, the true front line of the war against the monsters. The face of the Wall that faced the battlefield was steeply sloped, and on that slope were thousands of metal spikes that pointed out toward the oncoming monsters. At designated places between those spikes were staircases, ones completely drenched and stained with blood and at the frontmost edge of the top of the wall were hundreds of pill boxes and entrenchments that dwarves occupied at all hours of the day to combat the oncoming hordes. The majority of dwarven soldiers were mages. There weren't many warriors as it was far riskier to do close quarters battle. If they used more warriors, then the war would become too costly. Instead, they opted for constant long-range bombardments but there were some battalions called retrieval groups that were in charge of collecting corpses or hunting high-strength targets. 
Dirk saw several such groups that came and went from the wall, ferrying piles of monster corpses that went straight to processing. It seemed like the entire military force of the Dwarven Haven was stationed at this wall with the sheer amount of mages that occupied every inch of its surface. This place, while bloody and dangerous, has become one of the most significant economic factors for the Haven. Monster materials have become so cheap that craftsmen are producing a prolific amounts of weapons and armor. The only issue is that we have no way to export all the gear to sell it to other empires. Of course, that all changes if your railways are as good as you say. Give it time, General Varmite. You won't be disappointed. Pandora only smiled as they walked into the wall itself. Down within the chambers of steel was an entire city of its own. Barracks for soldiers, space for civilians that did things like cook and repair gear, and all kinds of recreational areas. The corridors and structures within went down as deep as 300 meters, making it far more spacious than one would guess from above. General Varmite took the three tourists to a luxurious hotel where she gave them accommodations. How long do you plan to stay? She asked Pandora, who pondered for a second. I'm not sure. Perhaps a few weeks. Very well. If you need anything, the other generals will be in the command center. I'll be heading back to the capital, so this is where we part. I appreciate everything you've done for us, General Varmite. Pandora said her goodbyes, and like that, the large female general left. Then, Pandora turned to the other two. Exos, go get comfortable. Dirk, we need to talk. Grabbing Dirk's hand, Pandora dragged him into her room, leaving Exos behind. After heading into the small but luxurious living space, Pandora waved her hand and created a dome of ice around them that isolated all magic and sound. Then she started speaking English. You must know why we're here. The key. Dirk answered simply. Within each of the dragon lairs were the key artifacts, and they were currently right outside one. But there's no way we're just throwing ourselves into the lair. Dirk furrowed his brow. If it were Pandora, it was completely possible that she would do something like that. But within it were monsters that far outstripped them in strength. Dirk wasn't trying to die just yet. She rolled her eyes. Of course not. Miss Record? I'm here. Please enlighten us as to the plan you notified me about a while ago. Pandora took out her Book of Life, prompting the Record to start spilling the details. The key artifact of Earth is within the lair, but it is not inactive. It has gained a mild amount of sentience, becoming active after the dawn of the war. Now it leads monsters. The hell? How did it become sentient? The key artifacts are not simply physical objects. They are half-living beings, not unlike a stigmata that is created from a soul. Its sentience is not unexpected, and the plan is based around that expectation. The record explained, causing Pandora to scratch her head. All right then, fine. So we've got a living object running around with the monsters. How do we get to it? You won't. Pandora was surprised by the answer. The key artifact has been active near the entrance of the lair for some time. It continues to develop its thought process as the war continues. It desires to be free, and to be free means it must bind itself to a person, taking hold of their being and attaining faculties greater than what it has. So with the right temptation, such as some backdoor keys to unlock itself, it will come of its own volition. So we're baiting it out. Great. Pandora took a seat on a nearby couch, lounging back. Fine. I'll use my magic and goad it here. Once it comes, we'll have to head into the battlefield ourselves and capture it. How powerful is it? Unknown. Its existence can only be sensed through the elements. But regardless, the only way it would be more powerful than Tier 4 is if it broke its own seals with the sentience it has developed then we're going to hope that it isn't any greater than a tier 6. That's about the most that both of us could handle if we work together. All right, I'll start building the spell. Dirk. Pandora turned her head, facing her partner who was laying face down on the bed. He hummed back. H.M. If you could, try and get on one of those retrieval squads. 
we need to know the layout of the land so that we can capture this artifact when it comes. We also need escape routes out of this stronghold. Fine. He, thank you. She pranced over and jumped on him, laying on top of his back. Then, she whispered into his ear. Hey, how's the armor coming along? Fine. It's almost done. Well, spend a few days to complete it. You said it could merge with Obsidius, right? Machem. Then do that first. Speaking of, where is that blob? On me. He mumbled, and Pandora could feel a weird sensation through his clothes, as if his skin were wriggling. She pulled down his collar, and under his shirt, she could see the black armor. He had been wearing it this entire time. She clicked her tongue. You're always so paranoid. Well, when rank eights try to fight me, I get worried. Maybe you shouldn't look at them wrong. I don't even have eyes. He shouted an injustice, causing Pandora to laugh. General Umangit entered his own residence, a large suite suitable for one of the strongest people in the world with the best luxury money could buy. On a nearby table was an orb, which he tapped while sitting down. A holographic screen displayed itself, showing a long list of names. He scrolled, stopping at one and selecting it. It rang for several seconds before a voice came through. Ho ho! If it isn't you manned it. Hello, Tobastin. It's been a while. The general greeted his friend with a smile, earning a hearty laugh. Ha, ah, it's been many years, friend. Tell me, did you break your staff swinging it around again? No, but my armor could use a bit of maintenance if you ever think about visiting. Hmm, anything that can so much as blemish that armor is extraordinarily rare. I hear you guys are fighting the monsters coming out of that lair. Holding up well? Good enough. And hopefully soon we'll be building something that'll cement our position here. Hmm. Tobastin hummed. So, what has the Iron General contacted me for? I wanted you to look into somebody for me. A human from Horizon. Oh? I hope you're not making me a spy. Tobastin's voice became cheeky, causing Yamangit to roll his eyes. That depends on the kid. I have a feeling he went through that academy you're at. Eh, fine. What's the name? Maybe he's got a record. Dirk Strider. Tobastin went silent for a moment. Him? Ha ha ha. So he's at the Haven. All right, spill. How do you know the kid? Umangit had a weird smile as Tobastin cackled. Ha! Ah, he's no mere kid. I'll let you know, I made him my apprentice. His talent is unlike anything I've seen. Such precision and focus, the dexterity of a prodigious dwarf in a human body. And his elemental manipulation. He's a monster for his age. Yeah. Umangit couldn't help but agree. There was a reason General Feller confronted Dirk. The feeling of having a knife around your neck was something Tyr and Rank Eights had long forgotten. They had reached the pinnacle, the ultimate in utter destruction and power. They were behemoths who stood above all. So, to feel your neck tingle, to feel like you were cornered, set off more alarms with them than any other. And if the source of that threat was a little boy not even a fraction of your age, becoming quite uneasy was normal. Well? What did you want to know about the kid? What sparked the curiosity anyway? No, more than that, how did you even come in contact with him? Spill it. Okay, okay. You Mangit waved with a chuckle. Believe it or not, he's traveling with a vampire princess. They came to the frontier stronghold for some reason, and General Feller got interested after we met the boy. Interested how? He wanted to fight him. Huh. What a buffoon. You mang it, if that feller lays a hand on my apprentice, I'm coming over there with a bomb. Don't test me. Tobastin howled across the orb, causing you mang it to sigh. Yeah, I'll let him know. Now tell me, what the hell is up with that kid? Even I felt tingly around him. Heh, I'll let you in on a known secret here at Horizon. Tobastin chuckled lowly. That kid is the son of an assassin. 
a couple years ago he disappeared after getting snatched by the Azuras, and he only reappeared when Emperor Horizon came out of seclusion. And when he came back, he was even more monstrous. Have you seen those eyes? He can't look at you, but damn does his gaze send a chill up my spine. Azura? Umangit's gaze narrowed hearing the name. Yeah. The Azura. Only the highest nobles know about Dirk's kidnapping since the Emperor wanted to keep a tight lip about it. But basically, the kid was forged in hell. Heh, he was already talented before, but that was the cherry on top. It makes sense. Suddenly, Dirk wasn't such an anomaly anymore. Sure his circumstances were still extraordinary, but at least he knew some of the details now. Tobastin sighed. His mother is nothing to scoff at either. Friend, take care of that kid, or you're going to seriously regret letting him anywhere near your stronghold. Oh? I can't say I'm afraid. Mf, we both know it's not yourself you gotta worry about. Tobastin's voice went low. Everything and everyone around you isn't as tough as that steel body of yours. Pick who you mess with wisely, because some people can't be caught by those dirt cages of yours. Umangit was silent. After a few moments though, roaring laughter came from the orb. Ha ha. Have fun with that. I'll be calling from now on for updates on him. I'd like to know how my apprentice is doing. Oh. Better yet, give him one of your communication orbs. I want to talk to him and make sure he hasn't been skimping on his training. Hmph, we'll see. With a wave, Umangit shut down the orb. He sat back and rubbed his temple. Who the hell just walked into my stronghold? And why is he with the princess? I don't like it. With a sigh, Umangit stood and walked out of the room. Let's just keep an eye on him. Come morning of the next day, Dirk searched around the stronghold. The place was a city unto itself, despite being a frontier stronghold. You could find everything here that was normally in a city, and perhaps some things that you wouldn't find. While wandering, Dirk found a red light district, one that contained not just dwarven women, but assortments of elves, hybrids, and human girls. Then there was a massive commercial district where the meats and products of all the monsters that were killed were sold. Many craftsmen sold dozens of different products from jewelry to weapons and armor. And the weapons trade was the biggest industry at this stronghold, for a good reason. There were many soldiers who needed to keep their gear tidy or outright replace it, and the military couldn't always be the ones to produce it themselves, especially not at a moment's notice. The place was self-sufficient with the source of materials that was constantly trying to break down their door. So it made things cheap and bountiful. But Dirk wasn't wandering to take in the sights of risque women or racks of longswords. No, he was plotting escape routes. He did what he had done at the capital city, but at the same time he questioned why he needed to plot a path out of the capital if they were going to be here anyway. If they got into trouble, would they really return to a then hostile city? It made Dirk sigh. Contingencies were always smart, but setting yourself up for success was just as important. It seemed like he was doing nothing but throwing himself into trouble. He was only preparing for things to spiral into hell, preparing for the worst case. But in that case, he supposed Pandora was the one setting them up for success. After all, she was really good at scheming, and he was really good at surviving. It could be said that they were playing to their strongest suits. Wait. Dirk paused for a moment as he continued that thought process. At first glance, they were going about this in the best way possible. They were both playing to each other's strengths. But at second glance, Pandora seemed to be disregarding the disparity in power between them and their potential enemies, thinking that their contingencies would be able to work under the nose of a tier 8. But that was impossible. Pandora was too smart for that. She knew her enemies better than her friends. Dirk would never say that anybody was better than her at doing what she did. Not just anybody could fight against global establishments and win with a fraction of the backing, after all. She knew his limits as well as her own, and she was taking into account those of a higher level and their ability to interfere with her plans, or their ability to discover them. There was much that Dirk didn't even want to think about, 
but he knew that if he could think of something so simple, then she had thought ten steps ahead. So since this was the case, I guess I should trust in her ability a bit more. You don't need to trust someone to trust in their actions. Just let her do what she's good at. And she's at least not trying to kill me and wants me around, so I can assume any plan she comes up with won't end in my death so long as I don't ruin the plan myself. He mumbled to himself. Dirk's thoughts on Pandora personally were a bit jumbled. He didn't know whether to trust in her because many of his impressions of her were questionable at best. In this life, she was nothing but good to him. In his past life, her schemes had gotten him embroiled in conspiracies that ended with his own and his sergeant's death. Though, she couldn't be blamed for that. It was the people who he had thought were his leaders who ended up betraying him. She had never meant him any personal harm beyond their situations, and she even brought him along to this place. Beyond that, it seemed like she was constantly trying OT reconcile and become close to him. Dirk's thoughts spiraled down a rabbit hole that made him question his relationship with Pandora. And it ended with a single conclusion. Maybe I'll give her a bit more blood when I get back. Chapter 142 Seal Dirk stopped by at his residence. His thoughts had carried him back here to seek out Pandora. His room was technically their room. She insisted that they shared because she was really into the delusion of him being her consort. But she wasn't at the residence when he arrived. And since he couldn't possibly guess where she might have been, he decided to attend to his main priority. His armor was almost finished. In fact, the snake scale body armor was already completed. He had finished the final touches on it while at the capital. But the last piece was something he couldn't finish without a proper forge room. The helmet. It was already designed and was going to be made with the remaining chunks of turtle shell. So Dirk sought out a place that he could forge. He initially thought to go outside behind the stronghold and bring out Pandora's mobile forge room, but deciding it would be too conspicuous, he opted for going to a forge within the city. There were plenty of forges, more than he could count. And there was one big place that many forge masters went to in order to forge because they couldn't buy or build entire properties of their own within the city. It was called the Palace of Bellows, and it was a tall structure that spiraled toward the ceiling of the stronghold. On all sides you could see vents that spewed smoke and waves of heat from all the active forges. Dirk went into this place and talked to the dwarven receptionist. A human forge master? This is a first. I just want a room. As long as you got the coin. What's the grade of the metal? The dwarf asked while jotting down words on a sheet of paper. Dirk answered back. Grade 5. Do you need a flame? No. Do you need a hammer? No. All right. He finished and scribbled down more lines. Then, he tore out the sheet of paper and turned, finding a room on a long list behind him. He eventually found one and pasted the sheet down on top of it. He then retrieved a key. We have an hourly rate of 200 silver for this room. You can stay for as long as you like, but the clock ticks for every second that you're in there. Also, you can rent tools. They have their own hourly rates. Okay. Then once you give me a gold for deposit, you can head on up to room 480. In the event that you stay for less than 10 hours, your deposit will be partially refunded. Fine. Dirk casually tossed a gold coin, and the dwarf gave him the key. He didn't so much as ask for a name. With that, he ascended the structure, quickly finding his way to room 480. He entered and was hit not with a wave of heat, but biting cold. It seemed these rooms were really good at dissipating heat and considering how hot temperatures could climb and how destructive it could be, this cold was a good thing. In the room was an anvil and a fire pit, along with an assortment of basic tools. With that, he called upon Obsidius. The blob bounced in response before covering his hands, turning into gloves and igniting with a vibrant flame. The living flame quickly warmed the surroundings, and after taking out the chunk of turtle shell, he walked over to the fire pit. He dipped his hands into the pit with the chunk of metal, and then, the living flame spewed forth, burning his mana as fuel. The temperature rose exponentially, but only within the fire pit. 
These pits were designed not just to produce heat, but to contain it, allowing someone to achieve temperatures far above the norm. It did the same with mana, insulating the fire mana and forcing it to affect the metal, making the heating process far more efficient and powerful. Dirk didn't use these fire pits before because he couldn't exactly throw an entire massive turtle shell into a fire pit. But now that he had gone through most of the material, he had a small enough amount to allow him to go about things normally. The chunk of metal quickly turned yellow hot, and Dirk could see and feel it become malleable. So with that, he brought it out onto the nearby anvil and retrieved the hammer. It was one of the hammers that was within Pandora's forge, specifically tailored to the metal element. And with everything in front of him, he began. The process of shaping a helmet was complex. Dirk had forged a helmet before with Tobastin, along with all other pieces of armor and gear. So he knew the process and techniques, though he wasn't as skilled as the dwarven master. But the beauty about these metals was that you could try for as long as it took. You could keep reheating the metal and there was no limit to how much you hammered it. So Dirk focused on making the general shape. He bowled out the chunk before refining the general structure. It was everything after this that took his utmost concentration. The proportions, the smoothness, the angles. All the little details had to be accounted for, and if there was one thing Dirk wasn't magnificent at, it was art. Forging was an art form no different from painting. It required one to see their grand vision in the small steps that they took. And while there were techniques to help guide your steps, the path you took was ultimately up to you. Dirk wasn't good at being creative like that. He could see the grand vision, the final product, but his method of getting there was more so through brute force. He forced his creation to bend to the image of the end product. He hammered away until he saw bits of the final product, and like that he would slowly refine. It was a brutish way of doing things. It was merely putting together pieces in a puzzle, not shaping the pieces and configuring them yourself. But Dirk was precise. That's what Tobastin had seen in him. He didn't see an artist. Instead, he saw a machine that would bend the unyielding metal under his hammer to his whim until it became what he needed and it worked flawlessly. The end result was always the product he wanted. And it was no different with this helmet. Dirk could gradually see the inklings of the helmet come to fruition with each hammer strike. In his vision, he could see the crude product in his hands slowly fitting into the mold as spite assisted him with measurements and small directions. Any small imperfections were handled with his fingers, like smoothing out surfaces or curving edges. And after several hours passed, Dirk was close to the final product. It would take a while to properly refine the helmet, bringing it to perfection before tempering it. But it was no longer crude. It wouldn't be finished now though. Dirk stopped before exhaustion, deciding to go to his residence and recover. Spite jumped out with her cat form. Now that she no longer needed to focus on helping him, she could walk around and personally explore a bit. The two strolled through the city before happening upon their hotel where Spite took a place on Dirk's shoulder. Making his way and opening the door to his room, Dirk entered. And this time, Pandora was there. Since it was now late into the evening, she was dressed in something like a nightgown, looking positively arousing. And perhaps it was this image that was desensitizing him, because no longer could ordinary women catch his eye. Not even those scantily clad ladies at the brothels could draw his attention. Well hello there. Out exploring the feminine delicacies of the stronghold? She asked with a smile, causing him to respond back bluntly. Forging, which is arguably more enjoyable. Yeah, until you get that cherry of yours popped. Are you speaking from experience? Dirk questioned back with a small smirk, already knowing the answer. And as expected, Pandora dodged his gaze. Not really. I wasn't normal back then. Any guy that tried often ended pitifully. Well, I wasn't normal either. Anyway. Getting to this point, Dirk blanked. He had wanted to ask Pandora some things, but it felt weird to actually ask. He wasn't sure what to say. So he gathered himself for a bit. And Pandora watched him in silence as if expecting him to eventually say something to her. I had a question. If I can answer it, I will. 
she tilted her head while lounging back on the bed. Dirk also took a seat on the edge of the mattress, pondering before finally asking. I wanted to ask you about, well, you. But I'm conflicted. I don't know if I can trust your responses. I can't say that I'm sure what would change that. Are you looking for my word? A promise that I won't lie? No. He shook his head. But I want to trust you, so I will. Kind of. I feel like I have a decent grasp on who you are, so I'm going to trust my judgment until I no longer can. Really? What gives you confidence in your judgment of me? Well, we've spent a lot of time together recently. I've been pondering your every move, questioning your every action. I've seen several new sides of you, both good and bad. Like how you barely helped while fighting at the city, even though you could have saved many more lives. But in the first place, you agreed to go there and let me help even though you didn't want to. I can see you actively trying to help me. So I ask. Dirk turned his head toward her in focus. And Pandora turned somber, not taking his question lightly. Can I trust that the plans you scheme, the things you do, the places you bring me to, won't end in my death? I want to get stronger, and I suppose I'm using you to those ends. And you're using me for my combat ability in order to garner influence and similar strength. But I need to know that our partnership goes beyond us being useful to each other. I need to know that you won't betray me, not because you may fear my strength or the ramifications, but because, you see me as something more than a tool to be used. Dirk found himself slowing his words, his voice deepening in slight emotion. Why did he seem to hate Pandora so much? Several weeks ago when they first met, he hardly knew anything about her. He didn't know anything about her habits, her mannerisms, how deep or shallow her psychosis was, or her thoughts about him. But he did know one thing. He had been used and betrayed, and Pandora was someone who excelled in that field. He hated that, and by extension had been unrelentingly distrustful of her. He only stayed with her because, as he said, he was using her for resources and strength. But things were different now. Many weeks later, he wasn't so distrustful. She was growing on him. And now, his question could be said to be an ultimatum. Pandora surely saw it as such. According to what she knew, Dirk only trusted a single person in this world unconditionally, and that was his mother. He didn't even show that trust toward his father and especially not toward his brother Ethan. He was someone who would only trust the closest person to him, someone who had been with him since birth, had raised him, and who shared a deep connection through similar experiences. And now, he was offering some of that trust toward her. She could take it easily, and she could use it to her advantage. But if she ever broke that trust, then she would never see it again. She pondered in her mind. Taking something complex like the bonds of trust and making it simple. He gives it to me, and from now on, I either maintain it or break it. It lets him read our relationship easily. I could turn into an enemy on the flip of a dime. But. I can tell. He does this because he wants to trust me, at least a little. His mother changed him quite a bit. Not so heartless. He's actually willing to make friends and develop a relationship instead of blocking everything out. So I suppose I've grown on him. Pandora got to this point in her train of thought, but then she suddenly stopped. I always analyze things like that, don't I? She sighed inwardly. Dirk wasn't the only one who couldn't navigate relationships normally. So she thought. Instead of going about this in a psychopathic way, why don't I do it organically? But, what do normal relationships entail? Like, love, kissing, sex, presents, flowery words, money. No, maybe not money, mainly emotion. Then again, what's normal about our relationship? I need to think of something that will please him but not come off as manipulating. In that case, it might be something that I don't want to do, because why would I do something detrimental to myself in order to manipulate him? But maybe that's exactly why I would do it, to lure into false security. Pandora racked her mind, spiraling into a loop of self-contradiction and doubt. It led to a long bout of silence, one that confused Dirk. He wasn't sure what to think as Pandora's face scrunched while groaning came from between her lips. 
was this that hard for her? Finally, after waiting a while, Dirk got a response. Let's, make a seal. Seal? He was more confused as she inched toward him, her eyes on his neck. A blood seal. It's the deepest blood pact you can make with a vampire. It seals the blood of both parties and ties them to each other. If I do that with you, then I would never be able to drink someone else's blood again. You would be my sole source of vitality for the rest of my life. And for vampires, it's no different from getting married. To some extent, we could also feel each other's emotions. You would actually chain yourself to me for the rest of your life in order for me to trust you? That is what you want, isn't it? She looked at Dirk with dead serious eyes. No matter what I think of, there's no other way for you to trust me. I want your trust, Dirk. And I know superficial affection won't do anything to you. So, this is my ultimatum. Bringing up her hand, the Book of Life appeared, flipping through until it revealed a set of pages with blood-red inscriptions on it. She put it between them and then bit her finger, drawing blood and smearing it across the page. One half of it then flashed, waiting for another half to join. Dirk could feel the ritualistic power behind the complex runes. And if he put his blood in there, then he would be able to make this blood seal with Pandora. He gazed into her eyes, seeing the blood mana within her getting agitated. She was really going to make the seal. He asked. Do you want to do this? If it's for you, then yes. Dirk went silent for several moments before reaching his hand over. And he closed the book. The spell shut down, surprising Pandora. They sat there in silence for a moment before Dirk sighed and nodded. I understand. Pandora watched as he started undressing, putting on something more comfortable before climbing into bed. I'm tired from forging, so I think I'll go to bed early. He mumbled while turning off lights, the room going dark. Snapping out of her daze, Pandora realized what was happening and slowly climbed over to his side as he got under the sheets. The Book of Life closed, all the agitated mana in the room dissipating. She went under with him, seeing his back that was facing her. And after a few minutes, Dirk could feel an arm wrap around him. Pandora liked to get cuddly, and he would usually bear with her presence or push her off. But this time, he let it be. He fell asleep while feeling her press against his back, his mind filled with an odd sensation. Chapter 143, Armor Can I watch you finish your helmet? I suppose. Dirk shrugged while walking out of the room. Upon waking, he and Pandora hadn't said much to each other. He was still processing their succinct talk last night, accepting the fact that, for once, he wasn't going to doubt her every move. After they ate a morning meal, Dirk said that he was going to forge. Since Pandora apparently didn't have anything to do, she wanted to follow him. So the two went back to the Palace of Bellows, getting a room. There, Dirk brought out his helmet. The overall shape was already there, so all he needed to do was sharpen it up and finalize the details. Pandora watched as he heated the helmet inside the fire pit with the living fire from his gloves. The helmet resembled not a knightly helmet, but a futuristic helmet from Earth. It covered the neck and had its own sleek shape that wholly covered his face. There were no weak points to exploit like openings for the eyes or mouth. And it was infused heavily with metal mana, leaving no room for any of the other elements. This was how many of the strongest armors were created. Such rigid metal mana would reject any form of magical or physical disturbance. It was so effective, in fact, that enough metal mana acted as a form of magic resistance. Of course, armor pieces like this also couldn't be enchanted with other elements, denying any form of utility. For some, this was unacceptable. But to the side, Pandora was more so curious about Obsidious than the helmet. The blob could apparently absorb pieces of armor and add them to its armor body. How this integration occurred, she wasn't entirely sure especially when it would come to pieces like this helmet. Thankfully, the wait wasn't too long. Dirk finished the final touches within the hour, and then, he went through a tempering process. For basic metals, the tempering process was a way of hardening the metallic structure of the material, 
giving it certain properties that could make it tougher, more resistant to deformation, or the opposite. But working with magical metals was different. Sure, the atomic tempering still occurred, but there was also a tempering of the mana within the metal. If the mana was turbulent, then it wouldn't be as effective within the product. The metal mana within the helmet needed to be solidified and hardened in its own way. This would make it several times tougher. And this tempering occurred through a series of steps that could be considered pseudo-enchanting. Dirk recalled some runic formations within his mind, ones that Tobastin had taught him when he had returned to Horizon. And he wrote them not with metal mana in the air, but with the metal mana already present in the helmet. His finger touched the back of the helmet before tracing, drawing a complex series of runes. It looked like he was engraving the helmet, and the impressions he drew covered its entire backside. Pandora watched from the side with interest. She enjoyed seeing Dirk become so engrossed in forging, though she wasn't sure why. Maybe seeing him show such passion for something other than killing had her a bit wondrous. Finally, once he finished engraving the runes, they melted into the helmet and disappeared. After that, all the mana within was locked to the metal before hardening. When that happened, the helmet rapidly cooled from a dull red to a deep silver. All the fire mana from the living flame was driven out. Just like that, it was finished. Dirk took a deep breath as Obsidius slid off his hands, bouncing around in glee. He smiled and grabbed the helmet with one hand. The helmet couldn't actually be slid onto his head. It wasn't built with that in mind. With a thought, Dirk willed the scale armor into his other hand. Like the helmet, it was a single piece that couldn't be undone and slipped onto his body. Obsidius continued to bounce atop the anvil. Here. Do what you need. Dirk said that while laying the armor pieces beside the blob. Then, the blob suddenly grew. Its mass multiplied while engulfing the armor, swallowing it whole. Then, the blob shrunk back down, going still. It was like this for a while, and Dirk wondered if it was actually digesting his armor. But then, the body of the slime flashed as lines appeared across its body. These lines morphed into dozens of different forms, looking like wriggling worms across the slime surface. And the blob rolled off the anvil, hitting the floor before suddenly growing. Pandora watched with great interest. She saw the slime suddenly turn silver and expand. Before long, she actually saw the helmet appear, almost like it was built from the body of the slime. And then, from the neck came the rest of the scale armor. The slime grew, and everything appeared one bit at a time, the armor growing with the body of the slime. Each scale, each chain, and each piece of leather appeared one segment at a time. Spite appeared at this moment and analyzed the armor. Subsequently, she found that the armor appeared exactly as Dirk had built it. There were no flaws or deviations. The process took around five minutes to complete. After that time, Dirk saw the entirety of both pieces of armor. The scale armor looked just like the sleek body of those black lightning snakes in the major dungeon he and Pandora had gone through with the Grand Marshal Victoria. And each scale was blessed with the ability to easily conduct lightning and absorb copious amounts of heat, along with tanking lots of physical damage. Like a net that dispersed the force of an object across its entirety, this scale armor was able to absorb most of the damage that came its way. Dirk could barely put a hole through a single scale using the fullest extent of his aura with a knife. So trying to destroy many at once would be far more difficult. Of course, the lightning snakes weren't known for their defensive abilities. In fact, that was their downside despite everything. Their strength lay in their speed and lightning attacks. The only reason Dirk was able to use their corpses as materials was precisely because their defenses were weaker than others their level. But for Dirk's level, after combining these scales with the metal from that monstrous turtle shell, he managed to make an exceptionally strong piece of armor that was more than good enough for the enemies he could fight. Anything that could easily break through his armor could also easily kill him. After forming all the armor, Obsidius shrunk back down once again, bouncing over to Dirk and sticking to his leg. Then, the slime covered Dirk's body and spawned the armor, just like it would usually do with its armor body. After a few moments, Dirk appeared fully armored. 
Pandora observed the armor as he moved his limbs around. Congratulations. How does it feel? Just as I envisioned. Then again, I think Obsidius has a hand in how well it's morphing to my body. As he moved, Dirk could feel the effects Obsidius had on the armor. For one, the black armor body of Obsidius formed the first layer around Dirk's skin. Everything else was layered on top of that second skin. Not only that, but Dirk was able to sense how the armor was connected to Obsidius' armor body. It wasn't simply sitting atop the black skin. Instead, it had merged with the armor body itself, the entire thing becoming a single piece. Because of this, Obsidius could adjust the armor however it needed. And because Obsidius was integrally connected with Dirk, he could feel all the little details of the armor. He could feel the conductivity of the scales, the heavy metal of the helmet, and the strength of the chain links. With a thought, he raised his arm and sparks of lightning arced across the scales. They gave off heat, and Dirk could feel how easy it would be to launch a lightning attack using the scales as the medium. This, combined with the fact that Dirk completed muscle destruction, meant he could utilize lightning far more than he used to. While he may not use it offensively, using it to multiply his reflexes and power would become an integral part of his arsenal. At this moment, Dirk's combat power had risen to a new height. Pandora recognized this as well from the side as she watched him clench his fists. She had a red on just about all of Dirk's abilities, so besides himself, she knew the best just how strong he had become. Now, he would need to put it to the test. Pandora suddenly spoke. I have a matter to discuss with you, now that you're finished. What is it? Hearing the serious topic, Dirk willed the armor away, Obsidius retreating to its nest atop his head. Pandora sat back in a chair while looking up at the blindfold over Dirk's eyes. Yesterday, I was scouting the stronghold a bit, getting a read on its population. And I found something both interesting and concerning. The church? So you saw them too? Dirk nodded. While wandering the city and plotting escape routes, he had spotted several members of the sovereign church, along with a temple. Pandora sighed. They seem to have a large presence here, no doubt because of their healing abilities. In fact, the Dwarven Haven as a whole is one of their main headquarters. I would say the only other place they have greater influence at is the Hybrid Empire Unity, and tied with them is the World Tree. This is a fact we need to keep in mind, since they're basically our enemies in this war. They might be an obstacle in obtaining the key artifact. All right. Well, that's the only thing I really needed to warn you about. I'm almost done with my spell. However, even after finishing it'll take time to lure the artifact out of the lair. In that time, I suggest you find some battles to fight. I'm going to be occupied with business and operating that spell. Sure. The two stood with those words, leaving the forge. Oh, also. Pandora suddenly remembered as they walked through the city, switching her language to English. The key artifact is sentient and mobile. When it comes out, we'll need to subdue and grab it. This will happen on the battlefield, and the artifact may catch the attention of those above us. Plan for that inevitability, because not only do we need to grab it, but we need to leave with it. And, here's something you can use. She reached over and handed Dirk a black crystal, one filled with dark mana. After that, she explained what it was and how it worked. Hearing everything, Dirk realized what he needed to do. He took several more of those as they arrived at their residence. There, they saw Exos standing outside their door. Upon arrival, the dwarf faced them with his usual prim appearance. Lady Pandora, I was hoping I could ask something of you. Yes? I wish to go out and fight some beasts. You see, most of my augmentations are built with combat in mind. I would frequently go hunting in order to raise more funds for my projects. So I was hoping you could speak to the generals and have me placed in a unit so I could get some exercise. Oh? I didn't realize you were a skilled fighter. Pandora was pleasantly surprised, eyeing Exos with curiosity. He wasn't built with layers of muscles like normal dwarves. He was lean, which would be considered skinny by dwarven standards. And in a suit with his precisely kept appearance, 
he didn't seem like he could take a hit, let alone dish one out. But Exo seemed offended by Pandora's words, frowning ever so slightly. I may not be normal, but I'm still a dwarf, and my work is built for fighters. It would be worthless unless it could survive high-level combat, and in order to prove it, I have personally tested it and succeeded in no small share of battles. I'm a tier 5 metal mage and can kill a tier 6 beast with difficulty. If I couldn't do this much, then I may as well have given up on my dream. I see. Pandora slowly nodded. And from the side, Dirk was re-evaluating Exos. He had already seen tier 5 power within him. It was nothing that Dirk would feel threatened by, but it seemed Exos had more power than he initially realized since he could kill a tier 6 beast at all. It was impressive for a kid who used to be so disadvantaged. Pandora turned to Dirk with a smile. Well Exos, we just so happen to be on the way to see the generals. Dirk here also intends to go test his wit in no man's land. So it would be perfect if you could join him. At the very least, you wouldn't need to worry about your life with him there. I understand. Exos nodded, eyeing Dirk with the same curious gaze. Dirk had yet to show any of his combat ability, but since he was walking around with Princess Pandora, he surely couldn't be some nobody. With that planned, the trio made their way to the headquarters where they met General Yumangit. How can I help you, Princess? He asked as they appeared in his office. Business was as usual, and people like him didn't step out unless something seriously major was happening. Pandora was succinct, expressing their desire for Dirk and Exos to enter a unit to help combat the monster hordes. The general was surprised by this, not expecting guests to volunteer their services. But since they were, he didn't see a reason to refuse. In fact, he was quite eager to accept. Very well. You both are close combat fighters? Yes. Then I'll place you in a reclamation squad. They're headed by rank SIXS, so you'll be in good hands so long as you take care of yourself. But since you're not trained in our standard procedure, you'll also be responsible for preserving your life should you fail to keep up. You may get worn seriously. He couldn't expect to teach them how to operate with a squadron of dwarves, so it would be up to them to adapt accordingly. Pandora smiled reassuringly. Don't worry, General. If one of them dies, then they can only blame themselves. I don't expect you to hold their hand. Mm, very well. I'll send a message tonight. Report back here tomorrow and I'll send you off from there. Understood. Having those plans made, the parties bid goodbye for the day. Dirk decided to train his mana that night before going to bed. All he needed to do was comprehend the runes for the next step in his mana heart technique, so some hours were spent on that. And after settling into bed, Dirk went to sleep with Pandora curled beside him. Chapter 144 Reclaimer It was at times like these that he realized how small she really was. Waking up in the morning, Dirk took a glance at Pandora's figure. She was easily a head shorter than him, and her body that curled up beside him contrasted greatly with her lofty figure that she showed everyone else. Of course, he didn't pity her in the slightest thinking she lived a stressful life. Instead, he found himself thinking of Ava, and despite their vast differences, he couldn't help but sense a faint similarity between the two girls. Suddenly, Pandora shifted, her limbs spreading out as she stretched. She was waking. Her hand reached out, somehow finding his face and pushing against it. Her leg also wriggled its way around with a faint sense of purpose. Pandora's eyes squinted as she looked at Dirk beside her, going from pushing his face away to spreading her fingers and running it through his hair. Then, she grabbed it and pulled herself over, placing her lips against his neck. She bit down with her fangs, drawing blood and taking a long sip. This lasted several seconds, her body shifting atop his as she did so. And when she was finally done, she pulled away with a satisfied smile. This was a fairly new morning ritual. Pandora really hated mornings, but she found out that if she got a bit of Dirk's blood while waking up, all her grogginess would fade away. Of course, she also loved to get handsy. After getting her dose of vitality, Pandora laid on Dirk's chest, her knees snaking around under the sheets. 
Sensing her search for his forbidden region, Dirk frowned. Then, his hands shot out. Pandora expected him to push her off, but instead, she found his fingers grabbing her sides and poking into her ribs. H. No. Ha ha, not fair. She jolted violently as he tickled her sides ruthlessly, squirming around but unable to escape his grasp. It was only when she threw her body off of him that he let go. Taking a second to catch her breath, she looked over as he sat up with a small smile. She didn't say anything, but she couldn't help but realize that he was suddenly treating her a lot differently. They almost never played around like that before. He was always so serious, and any joking came from her end. She thought inwardly. Guess he was serious about trusting me. I'm glad. She smiled, feeling a sense of relief. After that, the two went through their morning rituals before grabbing some breakfast from the food storage ring. After they were done eating, they left their room and grabbed Exos. It was time to report. Within the stronghold there was one primary fort that acted as the central headquarters for all the dwarven soldiers to coordinate from. It was also the busiest place in the entire stronghold. Hundreds of dwarves ran to and from the fort, going to complete whatever assignments they were given. And Dirk noticed one small detail about many of the soldiers. They were young. Not many of them looked to be aged in any fashion, despite their generally hairy disposition. And since this also meant they weren't incredibly strong. They were shorter in height and their skin was paler unlike the dark and gray of strong dwarves. When one thought of dwarves, they usually conjured an image of the young ones in their mind, small but stocky men. Perhaps the war killed many, or perhaps the haven had a frequent cycling system for their soldiers, but this amount of young soldiers wasn't exactly normal. Plus, most of them were mages. Dwarves specialized in body refining because it capitalized on their inherent strength. Magic was usually secondary, only being learned for crafting. But the nature of this stronghold and the monster tides didn't allow conventional tactics. And on top of that, Dirk remembered that in recent times there was a sudden surge in people who could wield mana, resulting in an influx of mages for all empires. He had these thoughts while bypassing several crowds and some marching soldier formations. They were being led by General Yumangit personally, and naturally, everyone knew who that was, so they earned plenty of attention. It was at the gate of the fort that they stopped, greeting one particular dwarf who seemed to be waiting for them. He saluted with utmost respect, his stature large and skin dark as metal, signifying his strength alongside his nice robes with a high-class emblem on it. General Yumangit. It's an honor. Marshal Tanner. The general nodded at his salute before motioning to the trio behind him. It seemed the other empires had ranking systems similar to Horizon. These are the ones I told you about. Go ahead and bring them into your unit and give them a taste of the combat here. They're voluntarily offering their strength. I understand. They will be taken care of. Then I leave them to you. Princess, if you don't mind my escort. The general handed off Dirk and Exos, and since Pandora didn't intend to go with them, she planned on staying back and speaking with Yumangit. Before she left though, she turned to Dirk and reached out, her fingers straightening the collar of his shirt. She smiled. Have fun out there. Always. He smiled back as she turned and left with the general, the duo attracting no small number of eyes. Follow me. The marshal then waved them in treating them with respect since they had been personally escorted by the general. Not just anybody could get such treatment. But the marshal had already gotten an idea of just who exactly he was dealing with when he saw Dirk. So much as looking at him gave him a tingly sensation, making him feel as if he couldn't be safe before him. Granted, the power behind that feeling wasn't great, but the fact that this young human boy could threaten a marshal like him anyway was baffling at best. He didn't need to make enemies, so he did as was requested of him and brought these volunteers into the fort. It wasn't long before they arrived at what looked like a massive garage. The inside of the building was loaded with dozens of corpses, all of which were large and valuable, along with dwarves who tore them apart for their material value. This is where the reclamation squads bring their kills for processing. 
Our job is to kill high-value targets or reclaim the corpses of ones already dead. This means we must venture out into the battlefield, and this easily makes it the most dangerous job in this stronghold. As a team we look out for each other, but your life is still yours to protect. Don't be stupid and stain my hands with your blood. The marshal spoke seriously, and none of what he said was incorrect. However, Dirk didn't respond. He just continued walking, his blindfolded eyes not giving away any hint of seriousness or nervousness. If anything, the marshal could only sense a bit of amusement. On the other hand, despite his best efforts, Exos couldn't help but give off a hint of anxiousness. His face was stoic, as always, but his fingers still twitched occasionally, the kind of reaction the marshal had expected. Without much more introduction, he led them into a barracks. There, the normal bustle of the fort had decreased. What took its place was a large team of dwarves who walked around as if they owned the place. Dirk's first impression labeled them as adrenaline junkies. And perhaps that wasn't too surprising considering the job. You had to be a bit crazy to willingly throw yourself into the hellish no man's land beyond the solid walls of the stronghold. While none of the ones he saw were doing anything extreme or outlandish, their demeanor hinted toward that disposition. Dirk could see it in the way they carried themselves with no inhibitions and a certain level of relentless boredom. The marshal gave a succinct introduction that none of the others cared about. After that, he told everyone to prepare for the day. Their standard routine involved spearheading reclamation efforts, allowing wagons and personnel to recover corpses and materials. They would head to the sites of major bombardment zones that the mages had cleared out beforehand and do their work there. By now, the first bombardment was ending, so they would head out soon. Dirk was already prepared to fight, as was Exos. So they just had to wait. Everyone else in the barracks threw on their gear with practiced routines and started assembling. There were several other teams as well, many of differing levels. But it seemed that Dirk and Exos would be working in the marshal's team, probably in an effort to ensure their lives. He undoubtedly didn't want to risk them dying under his watch out of fear for the repercussions. He probably didn't want them there at all. After some time, the teams all assembled. Dirk and Exos stood within the marshal's group which consisted of only four people. They were the elites who were responsible for watching over the entire operation as they went out there. Move to staging. A shout was heard, and all the teams were moved through the fort and out to the stronghold's roof. They arrived among pillboxes and fortifications. In front of them was the sloped wall that was covered in countless metal spikes, along with corpses impaled across them. Now, Dirk was able to get a front row view of the battlefield. The monsters were led by generals, so the tens of thousands of monsters didn't wildly attack the wall. Instead, huge armies of them constantly moved, creating various currents like an ocean that churned in the distance. The movements created a faint rumble that constantly droned throughout the landscape, something Dirk had noticed a while ago. Only now, it was far more prominent. Dirk could see the monster waves in the distance, and in one area, there was a huge pile of corpses and fire along with the wild fluctuations of elemental mana. It was located between the stronghold and the currents of monsters. A recently bombarded zone, and the target of their mission. Reclaimers ready. A man yelled, and all the nearby dwarves primed themselves. Several wagons also began rolling out. At the same time, several rows of spikes suddenly retracted, making the slope flat and easy to run down. Finally, the voice gave the order. Commence. Ha! There were several shouts as a few dozen men shot out of the stronghold, stepping into no man's land and charging. Craters and ridges plagued the landscape, but it was nothing that could hinder the agility of those present. Dirk and Exos charged along behind the marshal and his team. Dirk kept up easily, and Exos seemed to be able to as well. But his running was peculiar. Dirk knew that one of his legs was a magical prosthetic, and it seemed that leg was much stronger than the other because it launched him forward with every step. His other leg merely steadied him. So he was slower but not by too much. They weren't running at full speed anyway, only keeping ahead of the wagons. 
It took only a few minutes to arrive at the site, and Dirk subsequently got a whiff of all the blood and smoke from the bombardment. There were also massive piles of corpses, most of them blown to bits. There had to be at least a thousand in the immediate area. However, there were also some scavengers. Several dozen monsters were found snacking on all the corpses. After all, it was easy food that they didn't have to fight over. These were the ones they needed to dispose of, as well as protect the wagons from any other stragglers. Take care of them. I count 23 rank 5s. 7 rank SIXS. A few casters in the back. The soldiers all started evaluating their enemies in what seemed like standard procedure. And then, without much suspense, teams went and started hunting. They all hunted in groups, keeping safe while disposing of the monsters as fast as possible. After all, getting caught by yourself in an unpredictable battlefield was a recipe for disaster. As for the marshal, his team went on the hunt without so much as a word. After surveying the place, he turned around to Dirk and Exos. All right, I'll have you guys join the teams to hunt. He spoke while glancing at Exos behind him, but when he looked around more, he couldn't find Dirk. He frowned. Where is your friend? I'm not sure. He disappeared at some point. Exos looked around with similar confusion. He barely even realized Dirk was gone at all. Meanwhile, the man himself had taken his own path to hunting. And unbeknownst to him, a general was watching him from atop the stronghold's tower, his eyes gleaming with great interest. Chapter 145 Lightning From General Yumangit's vantage point, he could see Dirk enter combat. And despite being so far away, clarity was no issue with a bit of magic in his exceptional eyes. And surely, it was a sight to see, even though he couldn't see some things. What exactly did it mean to be built for assassination? Most thought that assassins would only work in the dark, appearing for but a moment before taking a life and slipping back into the shadows. Their attacks were sharp, swift, lethal, and most importantly, stealthy. But in this world, anybody worth assassinating had enough power to protect themselves from danger. This meant that assassins weren't built as one would typically think. General Umangit knew about all types of battle. He stood at the pinnacle of this world's power hierarchy. He touched on the truths of the world and its inner workings. The knowledge he grasped couldn't be fathomed by most. And the things he knew about regarding the dark world that slithered within the foundation of every empire would never be glimpsed by anyone who didn't deserve to know. But it seemed that Dirk embodied precisely all those things that nobody should know. His lethal style of battle, the inhuman battle sense, and his ability to operate beyond the perception of those around him. He could turn any battlefield into a place advantageous for his work. It didn't matter if it was in broad daylight. Everything he did made him the icon of the perfect assassin. In fact, calling him a mere assassin didn't do justice to his horrifying skill in the art of killing. Even with all his knowledge, Umangit couldn't fathom just how scarily good Dirk was at delivering death to his enemies. In fact, he was sure that his only limiter was the power contained within his own body. There were a few dozen monsters around the site of the bombardment, and more had begun to make their way over in order to pick away at the corpses like scavengers. The longer the reclamation team was there, the harder things would become as they attracted attention and Dirk didn't cooperate with any of the groups that fought off the scavengers. Instead, he bounced between the groups, interjecting at just the right moments to either kill a monster or debilitate it to let the group finish it easily. His movements were erratic, and since Umangit was so far away, he couldn't quite keep up with everything he was doing. This was because he seemed to be using a version of void walking he had never seen before. He was also lightly using some stealth technique, obscuring him even further. Regardless, Umangit finally understood why this kid had given him such a bad feeling when they first met. He was basically the walking incarnation of death. Despite not having the power, he absolutely had the skill necessary in order to kill them. And the only reason he couldn't kill them was because, without power, skill wasn't allowed to cross certain boundaries. It was a baffling thing to think about. The mere thought of a child like this, not even a fraction of his age, being able to surpass him in any area related to combat was an impossible thought. 
but, if not for this, General Feller wouldn't have reacted as harshly as he did. It made Dirk an impossible existence. Someone so attuned to battle that, within his power limits, he was untouchable. All he had to do was grow his power, undoing his only shackle, and outright gaining the ability to kill everyone around him. Of course, the only saving grace was that power came in many different forms, enough to create a slight gray area at the limits of his power level. This gray area was perhaps the only uncertainty in Dirk's ability to kill someone. But below that gray area at least, so long you were within his sheer power limit. Your fate was already sealed. After watching Dirk battle for around 15 minutes, the general finally saw the entire team begin their return. Huge wagons full of corpses, now considered materials, were hauled back to the stronghold. He sighed while turning away. To think that this monstrous young man was also operating with the vampire princess Pandora. He knew how cunning she could be. There were no small amount of reports on her doings in regard to the vampire nobility and hostilities with Horizon. She was dangerous for a whole different reason. Combine those two together. Yumangit almost groaned. Let's just hope they leave before making any huge messes. The day consisted of five trips to bombardment zones for reclamation. Whenever Dirk headed out and entered battle, he would work on practicing his magic and refining his rook class aura. His void walking was perhaps his greatest tool for mobility, so he focused on it a lot. Stealth was also important, especially if he would need to escape from strong enemies anytime soon. Using these spells and pushing their limits allowed him to glimpse even more comprehensions into the dark element. But just as importantly, he also worked on his lightning techniques. The main one he focused on was the auxiliary technique he mimicked from those lightning snakes. Now that he had completed muscle destruction, Dirk could stream lightning through them without significantly damaging them. This didn't give him a boost in strength. His anima was responsible for that. Instead, it multiplied his speed and reactions. By sending a bolt of lightning through the right muscles and tendons, he could turn his legs into whips and make his punches explosive. He could also swing swords with far more force. It was like propelling his body with explosives. This also made it difficult to control, even when dialing the lightning down. But the results were without question. If he learned to accurately combine the strength of his anima with the effects of this lightning technique, he would be able to outright multiply his combat power without actually increasing his overall power level. Of course, this was the simple result. But a bit more realistically, Dirk had a long way to go before perfecting this lightning technique. It was brutish, a mere fraction of the ability the lightning snakes had displayed. They used it with far more deft and finesse, pulling far more strength out of much less power. It was why they could produce lightning attacks with terrifying explosive power, yet when Dirk let out a lightning attack, it was weak while consuming copious amounts of energy. His comprehensions into the lightning element were shallow at best. After all, he was taught nothing about it at the academy. He was barely taught anything about the metal element either. This was because these specialties were far too dangerous to be simply taught freely. The Empire would only allow one to utilize those specialties after they had chained you down, that chain being the military. This was what Dirk's mother had meant when she said that what he had been taught at Azure's Mountain was still extremely valuable. It wasn't because the spells or techniques themselves were exceptional, even though they were, but because nobody knew them. Dirk learned how to use his metal element to turn even basic earth magic into something several times deadlier. His earth guard had gained far more strength with the metal element integrated. And all the dark techniques opened up a world of exceptional lethality and horrifyingly effective curses. And now, his lightning element was finally being put to use. Even Azura didn't have anything for lightning, and what Horizon had didn't seem to be in depth. It seemed to be an exceptionally rare specialty. But Dirk wasn't out of luck, because he got something better than anything he could attain from Horizon or even the treasury of the Dark Kingdom. He got a gift from a lightning dragon, one that contained all sorts of profound details about the element as a whole. There was nowhere better to get something than from the source, after all. And not willing to waste it, Dirk had long since been sifting through that lightning crystal Yuvos handed him. 
only now though was he finally able to put things into practice. There was a long way to go, but even a single battle helped him clarify several details. And with his armor and muscle destruction completed, he could devote much more focus to these things. After returning from his first day of work, Dirk and Exos retreated to their residences. Pandora also met with them along the way. The two parties separated without many words, mainly because Exos was more tired than the thought he would be. He intended to get some early shut-eye. That left Dirk and Pandora to talk alone. She spoke to him in English upon entering their room. Did you make any progress with the crystals? No. General Umangat had his eye on me the entire time I was out there. I'll work as soon as he learns to mind his own business. Dirk grumbled a bit, making Pandora smile. It seemed as if the general thought he was being discreet, but his gaze was too outstanding to Dirk who was sensitive to just about every form of power there was. Because of that gaze, he didn't intend to do anything that would arouse suspicion. Pandora shrugged. That's fine. We have time. I've just about completed the spell, so I'll deploy it tomorrow. This means monster movements will begin to shift. Stay on your toes, and keep Exos alive. Mm, speaking of. Dirk started setting out platters of food as he relaxed. Obsidius also popped out of his clothes, bouncing around the dining table with childish excitement. It seemed to still be overactive from the day of battle. Exos has some interesting abilities. He's absolutely deft in combat, and his inventions are capable. From what I saw, his primary weapons of choice are whips. These whips extend from his arms and seem to be anchored to his body augmentations directly, allowing them to take the brunt of the force while attacking. It takes perfect advantage of his abilities and attributes. Well isn't that interesting? Seems like he isn't just a scientist. Dwarves do like to fight. I doubt he's much different. If he's able to build more augmentations for himself, then he'll only get stronger. Plus, his magic is rather amazing. He uses earth magic to control his whips in ways that physics normally wouldn't allow. They can lengthen significantly beyond their base length. They're also equipped with blades, allowing them to slice and grapple onto flesh like barbed wire. Dirk explained the abilities that Exos displayed in today's battle. They mostly consisted of earth magic, but Dirk also mentioned the presence of metal mana, something he likely saved for stronger attacks or defense. A dwarf having the metal specialization wasn't rare, so Dirk wasn't surprised that he had the same specialty. Unfortunately though, Exos wasn't a body refiner, so his ability to forge anything was limited. It was why he outsourced custom products to others for forging. On a tangent, Dirk also thought about how Exos had others produce potions for him that allowed him to install the augmentations onto himself and other test subjects like animals. This made him think that with his skill, he could forge things for Exos and Pandora could concoct the potions. Exos would then only need to enchant the augmentations. Maybe they could work together since that was the case. Though, if Exos would be taking up residence in the Dark Kingdom's capital in order to research more, then that wouldn't happen. It wasn't like Dirk and Pandora would just stop traveling to complete their missions. He thought it would be interesting though. Forging augmentations sounded interesting, so Dirk wanted to try. By the way, Pandora changed the topic after noting the details about Exos. I did some more digging into the church's presence here, and turns out, it's a lot deeper than expected. They've stationed a Tier 7 Light Mage here, and those of the church are basically the exclusive healers for this entire stronghold. So they're important to the entire population here, making things more complicated should we clash with them. Does that also mean this Light Mage can sense what you're doing? No, so long as I'm careful. That's the only reason I didn't finish my spell today. I'm reworking it. Regardless, the key artifact will come out at my beckon. We just need to prepare to snatch it and get the hell out of here, regardless of how. I've also prepared some other spells that should aid us in preventing others from figuring out about our target when the time comes. Pandora explained some more of her plan, making Dirk nod. It seemed like a solid plan, but the biggest uncertainty was how they were still underpowered. Despite being as accomplished as she was, 
Pandora wasn't a tier 7, so it was unknown if they could see through her spells or if they wouldn't notice the artifact when it emerged. They were taking a risk, one that Dirk didn't like. But they were already behind, emerging into the world only a month after the war started. Then they spent several weeks saving a city and heading to the Haven. They were only now working toward an objective. They couldn't allow other powers to take control of the artifacts, and the more time passed, the more they would learn about them. It wasn't impossible that, sometime in the future, they would need to battle higher powers for control of these powerful objects. In that case, the more they took control of, the better their ability to fight for the others. Dirk understood this, and because he was deciding to trust Pandora, he was moving forward with the plan. Since he decided to do this, he was all in. Nothing less would be enough to ensure a good outcome. Chapter 146 War Over the next few days, Dirk and Exos continued to work with the reclamation squads. They would deploy to different zones of the battlefield and collect materials before returning and resting for a time. But this wasn't Dirk's only objective. His primary objective was placing down the dark mana crystals that Pandora had given him around the battlefield as well as throughout the city and even beyond the stronghold. Not only that, but after reworking her spell that attracted the key artifact, Pandora managed to give it a function that used Dirk as a relay, allowing her to operate the spell from the stronghold while he was out on the battlefield. This made it more discreet and more effective since it was sending out some kind of signal deeper toward the dragon lair. The key artifact was mobile and working either inside the lair or just beyond it. The spell was meant to attract it, and the effects were almost immediate. For one, the reclamation efforts became much harder. Dirk was basically a beacon for the monsters when her spell was active, so those in the vicinity often attacked with greater fervor. Also, the ocean of monsters changed its patterns, alerting the officers of the stronghold responsible for keeping track of the big picture. It was like the ocean of beasts became agitated, the tides changing and crashing forward with greater frequency. This resulted in the dwarven army sustaining more casualties and the stronghold being placed into a higher level of alert. The reclamation squad was also given more tasks to complete, some that had them moving deeper into enemy territory and sometimes taking down a strong target. Most of the time it was a monster that could cast strong spells bombarding the stronghold and warranting a response. And this gave Dirk more leeway to do what he needed. It didn't take long to deploy all the crystals he needed to, and after being placed, they would conceal themselves so that monsters wouldn't go and eat them. So the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. And the target of the mission slowly started to show signs of itself, making Pandora excited. Even Dirk could feel its presence as it gradually moved onto the battlefield from its usual abode. But the aura it gave off made him realize that this mission would be more difficult than he thought it could be. It's close. I can't estimate anything now, but the next time you go out, you should be able to get a read on its power level. Pandora spoke to Dirk in the early morning. He had gotten busy since he was now an effective member of the reclamation squad, requiring him and Exos to report earlier than normal. But this was good for them. Just remember. Pandora straightened out his clothes before he left. I'll be on standby. If that artifact reveals itself and catches attention, then we'll move on it. Both of us are capable of reading a situation and knowing when to act, but I want you to trust my judgment and wait for my signal. It's possible that other variables will interfere, so we may need to move sooner or later depending on what happens. All right. But if it's weak, then I'll grab it. That's up to you. Just remember that this thing is meant to be the key to a source. Even at a lower power level, it's probably not an enemy you can take lightly. Don't be hesitant to retreat, because if you fight it, it could alert everyone including the generals. Then we're really screwed. Dirk nodded at Pandora's words. They were riding a delicate line. They would have to be subtle and act with absolution. They were going to be grabbing a treasure underneath the noses of several powerhouses and one mistake could ruin everything. But if Dirk was good at anything, it was shock and awe. If the opportunity presented itself, then he would bring out everything he had on the flip of a dime. Pandora trusted this part of him as well. She didn't believe he would make any mistakes. 
This wasn't unlike many of the missions he had completed as a super soldier. So she sent him off with confidence. Now, she only needed to wait and prepare to move herself. Dirk and Exos were deployed on yet another mission. Commence. The familiar shout rang out, and their troops sprinted out of the stronghold. This time, there were no wagons with them. Their target was a large monster that was bombarding the stronghold with water spells. Even now, Dirk could see massive amounts of water spells flying through the skies over their heads and slamming into the walls and fortifications behind. Dwarves would raise defenses, but the amount of water coming didn't allow them to lower said defenses. This meant they couldn't launch many of their own spells, allowing the monsters to charge forward with no inhibition. Their job was to penetrate the horde and take out the monster acting as a living artillery unit. Because of this, there were almost 200 dwarves running with them. This huge troop barreled through the ocean of monsters, clashing with magic and blade while spearheading toward the target. As for Dirk, he had another goal in mind. There was a reason these monsters were acting with greater aggression, and he could feel the source of their change. It wasn't a feeling of power that everyone could sense, but a feeling in the earth element itself. It wasn't unlike the feeling a dragon gave off the sovereign of an entire element. While the aura was obviously stifled, it was undoubtedly powerful. The key artifact. It's really as close. Dirk could sense the aura behind the monster that was launching water spells. So instead of helping the troop take down the monster faster and rid himself of a useful distraction, he shot ahead and activated stealth to its fullest extent. He disappeared, nobody even realizing he was gone. This was partly because nobody noticed and because people realized that Dirk naturally operated in the shadows of battle, so they didn't pay him much mind. He bypassed the huge water monster. It was actually a massive slime, easily standing 12 meters tall and composed of what seemed like an ocean of mana. Dirk couldn't really sense water mana, but what he did sense gave him a slightly oppressing feeling. This slime really was dangerous, as expected since it was a living artillery unit. Huge spell circles appeared around it, creating lances and shells of water that would shoot off into the sky and slam into the stronghold's defenses. Even from so far away they could hear the booms, and this unit wasn't undefended. The slime was guarded by no small amount of monsters, and that wasn't even mentioning the thousands of monsters already around it. So it would take some time to kill it. Dirk smiled at this fact before moving on. Even as the sounds of battle raged behind him, he kept his gaze forward. About. Five miles away. Let's hurry. Dirk estimated the distance before shooting off. His powerful legs carried him hundreds of meters with every bound, the fruits of muscle destruction showing themselves off. And his blood destruction ensured he had more than enough stamina to do this for miles. Combined with some magic, it took no more than a minute or so to reach the source of that aura. And what he saw left him curious. There was a small construction, what looked like a castle standing no more than twenty meters tall. It was entirely composed of stone, but Dirk initially mistook it for metal. The stone was gray and so compact that it had no imperfections to speak of, looking more like metal than rock. There was a gate leading into this small castle too and it revealed what seemed like a workshop. And from this workshop operated a humanoid figure. Upon closer inspection, Dirk actually made it out to be a suit of armor. This suit of armor would construct platings of stone and metal before equipping its guards with it. And these guards were actually golems, beings made of stone and metal themselves. Some were large, two standing taller than the castle itself, while the others were shorter. And from all of them, Dirk could feel a high tier. The short golems held a mana core standing at tier 5, while the taller golems were just barely below tier 6. And the suit of armor, the mastermind, also seemed to be the slightest bit below tier 6. Dirk settled his gaze on the suit of armor. That was it. The key artifact of Earth. The suit didn't look like normal knight armor. Instead, it was sleek, composed of layered plates of metal and various segmented structures. Dirk immediately knew that it was masterfully created, a construction of the highest level despite its lesser power. The shapes of each plate was perfect, 
integrating with each other in a synergistic way that resulted in both flexibility and unbreakable defenses. It was a perfect suit of armor, and the enchanted lines along its body revealed a far deeper power that Dirk couldn't even begin to grasp. I wonder if I could integrate that with Obsidious. But it's also sentient to some degree, so I don't know if combining the two is even possible. The little blob might die during the process. Still, it's armor I would love to have. Dirk pondered, wondering what it would be like to equip that armor. Not only was its construction perfect, but it was backed by an extremely powerful core. Dirk knew that it would be much more powerful than the height of Tier 5 if it wasn't for the seals the dragons had imposed on them. But this meant it only had room to grow. Dirk wanted it. He observed all this from a couple hundred meters away. Unfortunately, he also knew he couldn't subdue it. It was too powerful, and he hadn't yet seen its actual limits. He would need Pandora. However, before he could return, the artifact suddenly stopped. It turned its helmeted head, its non-existent eyes looking directly at where Dirk was located. Seeing that, Dirk didn't hesitate. He cast Void Walking, his figure flickering before appearing twenty meters away. Then, he bolted off back toward the stronghold. Unfortunately, just after taking a step to launch his body in a bound, the earth man around him surged. Large walls shot out of the ground, threatening to cage him in, while spikes threatened to impale him from below. Arrows also sailed down from above, heading straight for his dark figure. An attack from all sides. Luckily, Dirk's reactions were even quicker. Before the walls could even complete, he void walked yet again. This time, he took three steps. Three of his figures appeared in three different places, the third beyond the walls. Then, the previous two disappeared, leaving him beyond the cage. It took some energy out of him though, and if this continued, it would be bad. So he activated his anima and shot off faster than he'd come, covering 100 meters in a mere second. A few monsters who were in his way exploded as he barreled through them. This time, the artifact wasn't able to try and cage him in again. However, he could feel it on his tail. Behind him, the artifact was surfing on the ground, its feet riding a wave of dirt and rock and propelling it no slower than Dirk's sprinting. It put Dirk under a lot of pressure, but he knew that he couldn't be pinned down, so he continued as he was. At the same time, he found an opportunity to take out a small pendant from Pandora. Activating it, he initiated a call. Yes? Her sweet voice echoed in his mind. The response was anything but. I've been compromised. The artifact is on my tail and I'm retreating to the stronghold. Shit. She cursed before going silent. Now the situation was serious. We're acting now then. What's the power level? The smallest bit below tier 6, but it sure doesn't act like a mere tier 5. It's a suit of armor and can cast every kind of earth magic, including metal spells. Understood. Pandora went silent again, and Dirk continued to run. It was several moments later before he got a response. Continue toward the stronghold, but when in range, I want you to disappear. Honestly, I can already feel something in the distance, so there's no doubt the others do as well. Luckily, I've prepared some things. Here's the plan. She collected herself and gave the order. Arrive, disappear, and let the others fight it. We're going to borrow the strength of the stronghold. Nobody can know that the artifact is after you, or that you know of it in any way. Not until the opportune moment. Understood? Yes. Dirk responded with slight hesitation. Pandora obviously sensed this, so she gave one more reassurance before hanging up. Trust me. With that, her voice disappeared. Dirk put the pendant away, the artifact still hot on his heels. The delicate situation had turned even more so. General Yumangit suddenly stood within his office, his eyes turning to a window. What the hell is heading over here? He could sense a great disturbance in the earth element. There was no way it could escape his senses. Although pure souls were the rarest things to have in the world, those at the top of the power hierarchy either had one such soul or something very close. 
it was the only reason they could reach the level they did. Umangit, a tier 8 earth mage, could naturally feel exactly what Pandora had. Something was getting closer, and it held sovereignty over the earth element itself. But it was stifled, making it all the more curious. Like a dragon bound by chains. And unlike Dirk, Umangit could estimate its power even from so far away. Tier 5, but much more powerful. It's more like a Tier 7. Even then, one of my Tier 7 marshals may not be able to handle it. This thing is powerful, and no monster. He made all these deductions, and suddenly, the walls of his office bloomed open like they were made of fragments. He stepped through, the walls closing behind him as a platform of metal formed beneath his feet. Like this, he floated down through the air and arrived at the front of the stronghold. At the same time, there were some changes in the activity of the monsters. They all surged backward, away from the walls. In the distance, Umangit could see a reclamation team still battling with the water slime. But they were about to be overrun. So with a hand, he reached out toward them. From atop the stronghold, Pandora could see the general. There was no way she didn't have an eye on everything with what was about to happen. But she was still shocked to see what the general suddenly did. From his hand, earth mana exploded out, reaching across nearly a mile before hands of stone suddenly grabbed the entire 200 soldiers of the reclamation team. They were all moved back, being carried by these hands and dropped in front of the stronghold that was now devoid of monsters. Then, the general shouted, his voice amplified. Everyone to your battle stations. Full lockdown in effect. His voice rattled the entire stronghold. There was a moment of deafening silence, and then, alarms suddenly blared through the entire structure. Thousands of soldiers suddenly moved, mages surging into the topmost fortifications while body refiners took up defensive positions between them. Inside the stronghold, the entire city had retreated into buildings. Everyone who wasn't a soldier disappeared into their homes or safe houses. Just about every business halted operations. The words of a general were absolute here, no different than that of their king. And, when a full lockdown went into effect, it could only mean that this stronghold was about to fight for its survival. Of course, it didn't initially seem like it. Tens of thousands of monsters suddenly retreated, running away from the stronghold. But then, they stopped. Like that, they entered a stalemate, a massive gap of empty land between spiked walls and a ferocious army. A few minutes passed like that. It seemed like nothing was going to happen. But then, everyone could see something rising in the distance. It was a castle. But, unlike a stone castle, this one was composed entirely of metal. And it almost rivaled the stronghold in size. It was a few hundred meters tall, looking like a palace. And its entire construction was riddled with magical formations that glowed a deep silver. Once this structure was built, everyone could feel an oppressive aura wash over them. All the armies along the wall were focused solely on that castle and all its beautiful formations. But for those that were attuned to the power behind that aura, it felt like they were about to face a behemoth. General Yumangit frowned. Beside him, several of his most powerful subordinates assembled. They all gazed into the distance. And they watched as the armies of monsters gathered their most formidable creatures before the castle. They want war. Umangit spoke, his voice reverberating across the walls. It caused all the soldiers to snap out of their enamor. The next moment, their blood boiled. Dwarves were a race of people who didn't necessarily enjoy fighting. But they were always mistaken to be an aggressive race that would take a fight whenever the opportunity came around. But the reality was, arguably, the opposite. They were a peaceful people who loved to indulge themselves in the fruits of their labor and skill. Only, in order to preserve peace, one needed to be capable of great violence. That led to one mantra that all dwarves lived by. Peace through strength. When threatened by another enemy, when standing opposite to an army who wanted nothing more than to overrun them and destroy everything they had built over hundreds and thousands of years. They felt the call of battle. The war had beckoned them, and they would respond. Umangit's words only stoked that fire as he roared with passion. 
hoist the black flag. Today, we give them war. Ra! All the dwarves along the walls let out their battle cries, shaking the skies as all the mana in the atmosphere was kicked up in a hurricane. And with that as the signal, all the monsters in the distance suddenly flooded forward. The battle had begun. Chapter 147 Battle From amidst the dwarven army, Pandora could see dozens of black flags being raised. These were the wartime flags of the dwarven haven. To see these black flags was usually a nightmare. It meant that the dwarven army was at total war with an enemy. And if you were there to see those flags, it likely meant that you would die not long after. The haven hadn't been in a war for a long time. But Pandora had read many records about past wars, and all of them were basically tales out of legends. There was a reason they were the economic capital of the world and could stand unhindered. All races gathered in their empire to trade and do business, but none dared to encroach upon them despite being allowed to operate within their borders. It was because the dwarven people were perhaps the most fearsome of all the races when it came to war. In Pandora's opinion, only the humans could outclass them in that department. These black flags were a symbol which meant that the dwarves would hold their ground until the last man. And at no point in history did those black flags ever fall. General Umangit naturally realized the threat the artifact posed. It seemed like he had a better idea than even Dirk did. But there was one other factor that made him feel a greater sense of urgency. How unfortunate! To think General Feller suddenly had to leave. Who could have guessed a threat so great would suddenly appear not long after? Pandora smirked while speaking in a hushed tone. General Feller's sudden leave was one of her tactics. It was because she determined him to be a greater threat to their work than General Umangit. Taking that piece off the board was a way to eliminate variables. Because, unlike Dirk and similar to Umangit, she had a good idea of how strong the artifact was. Its power level was inconsequential. Instead, she was concerned about the fact that this artifact was perfectly attuned to the elements in every way. It had no less knowledge than a dragon, making it a deadly opponent to face. If it had been restricted to tier 3 or 4, then it may have been manageable. But now that it had been unshackled so much, she knew she couldn't handle it. So as she told Dirk, they would need to borrow strength and she was confident that it would be able to triumph over Umangit. Because how could Umangit, a mere dwarf, win in a battle of magic against a key artifact that was built by one of the strongest dragons in existence and made to operate a source? Umangit was lucky that the artifact was handicapped, otherwise he wouldn't have the slightest chance in the first place. Now, all she needed to do was wait. She watched as the castle was built, and she watched as the monster armies charged forward and she knew what they were after. Even now, the artifact was being goaded by her, the effects far more potent now that it was closer. She was tempting it with freedom. Her spell had been developed after the record shared with her details about the seals on the artifact. So she used these, projecting the keys to the seals outward. The artifact sensed these keys that would unshackle it and came running. After all, it had originally been tier 4 but it had broken free of one seal that allowed it to rise toward tier 5. But it had hit a wall, the seals becoming too powerful to simply break with brute force. It wanted Pandora's knowledge, and seeing as how she was being protected by the entire dwarven stronghold, the artifact gathered its armies and declared war. The monsters surged like a tidal wave, and from the dwarven stronghold came thousands of large-scale spells that exploded amidst the monster armies. Large gaps were created, corpses flying through the air as they were dismembered, releasing huge pools of blood. But the monsters seemed endless. Luckily, magic wasn't the strong suit of the dwarven army. At the forefront stood thousands of dwarven knights, their spears, shield, axes, and swords all hoisted and ready to meet their foes. They roared with valor, feeling their ancestral instincts kick into overdrive, their body entering a state of fight or flight. Only, it was too bad for the monsters that dwarves were too bulky to fly. They met the charging hordes head-on, and cut every monster down. R.H.H. Pandora could hear screams, not of pain, but of unbridled aggression. No dwarf fell to the first wave. 
their strength couldn't be matched by brutish monsters with no tact or skill. Their bodies were a steel wall that the fleshy beasts couldn't break down. But that was only the beginning. Suddenly, from the castle emerged five large golems. Unlike the ones Dirk had seen, these golems stood a colossal sixty meters tall. They looked like segmented robots with massive bodies of stone. And there was one golem that stood ahead above the other four. It took the lead with its entirely metal body. Hundred of spells landed on its body, but they merely left burn marks or small dents that did nothing to hinder it. Obviously, they were the elites. Beside them there were also some monsters that bloomed with savage auras of tier 6 and 7. Seeing this, you may get waved. All marshals, deploy. Oh yeah. The marshals all shot off the stronghold walls with excitement. It wasn't often that they got to battle a formidable enemy, so they relished in the opportunity. Several bodies flew or bounced through the armies, the dwarven elites launching themselves straight at the golems. Only, the golems' speed betrayed their stature. They swatted at the marshals with shocking agility, a couple of them being caught in mid-air and smacked to the side. A few craters were created, but the dwarves merely shot back out with brighter rage. This time, they were faster and stronger, arriving before the golems and chopping down with their weapons. Some also met monsters that came to intercept. Pandora watched as these demigods did battle at the behest of their kings. Only, she wasn't impressed by the displays. Her thoughts were otherwise, in fact. How can such stupid and brutish people come to wield such atrocious power? It's unfair to those who are so much smarter and skillful. Dirk could do dozens of times more damage with that level of power. She frowned for several moments as she watched the battles. Pandora's perspective as someone who had come from a world with no such powers was obviously unique. It was so even on said planet. On Earth, these dwarven elites would be nothing more than cannon fodder. At best, they would be a soldier only superior to the ordinary. But here, they wielded strength capable of dominating entire cities. She felt it unfair to those who were truly superior, and her icon of absolute superiority was Dirk. After all, he had been the most fearsome super-soldier on Earth. She felt that only he was deserving of such world-shattering power. Whatever. At least we'll be another step closer to that kind of power after all this. If he gets this artifact, it'll mean a massive jump in combat strength. She bit her thumb while watching. Even until now, she had no idea where Dirk was. He hadn't come back to the stronghold, so he was somewhere amidst that raging battlefield. He was lurking, waiting for the opportune moment. He was a shadow that drifted among the explosions and corpses, constantly watching and stalking his target until he could explode with everything he had to dominate his objective. Truly, Pandora couldn't think of anybody better to have at her side. To know that the greatest super-soldier was out there and that she could unhesitantly trust his abilities was the best form of assurance she could ask for. Normally she had to question everything about her subordinates, but not with Dirk. It was the main reason she also felt hurt at his lack of trust for her, and why she was so desperate to solidify the trust he offered. Several hours passed, and the battle was building towards its climax. The two true behemoths had yet to step out. General Umangit remained atop the stronghold walls the entire time his armies fought, never once leaving, and never once taking his eyes off of the artifact. That suit of armor sat atop its castle, acting similarly to Umangit. It oversaw all the monsters and watched as its golems fought the marshals of the dwarven army. Just faintly, Umangit felt that the artifact was resembling him, almost as if it were learning. And over time, Umangit also learned just how special the artifact was. It was no monster, and it surely wasn't one of the races of this world. It was a sentient, living object, and one that was attuned deeply to the earth element. Umangit realized this more than anyone, and he also realized that it would be an even more formidable enemy than initially thought. And the time would come for him to fight it. That time would come when the golems fell, determining the momentum of the armies and forcing the hand of the losing general. Only, Umangit knew it wouldn't be his hand that was forced. Because as time went on, he saw as his marshals dominated their enemies. It almost seemed natural that they would win, 
but the golems were shockingly powerful. None of the marshals had an easy time, and some had to assist each other. But they would win. Pandora saw this too, but unlike Yumangit, she knew that victory would come at a price. She knew the golems held more within them than the marshals thought, and that naivety would take its toll. In the middle of the battlefield, the five golems looked like they were swatting at flies as they fought the marshals. Occasionally, one of their hits landed, injuring the marshals. But for the most part, the battle was one-sided. The marshals slowly whittled the golems down. However, at some point, the golems' attack patterns changed. It seemed like the golems were mindless. They may have been agile, but a large target had a hard time hitting a smaller one, especially when they were fast. They weren't trying anything new. They were just acting like punching bags. It made Yumangit wonder why the artifact bothered building these golems in the first place if they would just stand there and take a beating. But then, out of nowhere, Yumangit saw as one golem expertly predicted the attack of one of his marshals. Said marshal wielded a large war axe, constantly chopping down and leaving huge scars across the golem's body. To him, it felt like he was chopping down a tree with how tedious the process was but even he could only respect just how resilient the golem's body was. But then, just as he was about to land another blow on the golem's shoulder, he watched as the golem's body tilted and a hand appeared above him. He barely braced before he was smacked down to the floor. Boom! His body cratered on the ground, taking out a dozen monsters underneath. Then, the golem shot down its hand, piercing into the ground and grabbing the marshal. The dwarf struggled as he only got a second or two to recover. He roared, exploding with bodily power and attempting to brute force his way out of the golem's grasp. But then, to his horror and the horror of those watching, the golem's hand morphed, and a dozen spikes shot out from its palm. The dwarf was impaled and skewered, his body freezing as the life instantly faded from his eyes. Umangit's eyes widened in shock, but that was only the beginning. Pandora's face was neutral as all the other golems exploded with their own morphing abilities, catching every marshal off guard and delivering blows far more dangerous than any before. It was like their programming had changed on the flip of a dime. But unlike the others, Pandora knew that there was no way these golems were built simply. The entire time, she could see them watching. She could see the light mana fluctuate around the golems as they took and delivered blows. They analyzed, learned the patterns of their adversaries, but were patient even under the beatings. And as soon as they saw an opportunity, they all exploded with the true depth of their power. How could they not be capable of earth magic? Their entire existence was running on magic in the first place. So the ability to cast magic on themselves, using their body as the catalyst, was almost too easy to predict. And the marshals adapted as soon as it happened. Unfortunately, a few were injured by the surprise attacks. And from then on, the tables turned. The golems suppressed each of their enemies, utilizing magic with shocking tact as they chained their blows and predicted the movements of the marshals. Their bodies morphed in odd ways in order to accommodate their tactics, and their large limbs only moved faster after exploding with power. Yumangit shivered in place. He couldn't easily enter the battle because then the artifact would move as well. That could endanger those below, especially if the artifact was indiscriminate. But one of his marshals had instantly died and several others were wounded. Everyone understood that death was a part of war, but to die against these monsters was far worse than in a war between another empire. Lowly monsters do not deserve to take the lives of their superior. Damn it. Feller, you stupid meathead. The one time I needed you here and you gallop on off to the capital. Umangit's roars echoed across the stronghold, his rage palpable and uninhibited. To the side, Pandora only smiled. Indeed, General Feller, a rank 8 body refiner, would have been able to single-handedly tip the scales. But she couldn't have that, now could she? And how sad was it that the only thing she had to do to get him to leave was promise him a personal train car? It was almost too easy. Soldiers, consolidate. Suddenly, Umangit yelled out an order, and the entire dwarven army heeded his call. By now, the dwarves had set up a defensive wall ahead of the stronghold. 
but on a whim, they abandoned the ground they gained and retreated to just in front of the wall. This command was used when the behemoths were about to enter. Umangit was preparing to deploy himself, but he would need to ensure the lives of those who could get caught in the crossfire. However, the process took time. And in that time, Umangit watched as two golems suddenly united. They moved toward each other, and in exchange for ignoring one blow, they combined attacks and pincered another marshal. This marshal, a sword wielder, found himself caught between four hands. And before he could even reach out to fight back, dozens of spikes jutted out, impaling him in several places. Umangit thought him dead, and he reacted violently. But then, he saw as that marshal moved. His aura exploded, his most vital areas barely kept defended. But he didn't have long. So, in one final blaze of glory, that sword wielder expended every last drop of energy he had. His aura blazed from within the spiked cage of the golem's hands, his sword swinging out in what seemed like all directions. Just like that, the four hands that entrapped him were all diced into several pieces. However, the marshal was only left to fall, his body rapidly cooling before his life was whisked away by the Almighty. His corpse was caught by another marshal who retreated. This marshal went back to Umangit, placing the corpse down nearby. The marshal looked toward his general, not with pleading, but with resolve. And then, he turned to head back out, despite his injuries. He would not let his friend's sacrifice be in vain. But before he could leave, he was stopped by a large hand. Umangit stood, his visage neutral, but his soul brimming with rage. That's enough. The general spoke while taking a step forward. Below his foot manifested a small platform of stone, carrying him into the air. The retreating dwarves watched as their general entered the battlefield, and they all let out cries of valor. The death of two marshals was a heavy price to pay, and not a single golem had yet fallen. Only two had been crippled, but those wounds were already regenerating. Umangit would stand by no longer. Retreat. His words were heeded, the rest of the marshals disengaging. But they stood at the ready nearby, helping their armies retreat while watching their general. As if in agreement, the golems didn't pursue. Instead, they gathered and stood before Umangit, forming a wall between him and their king. The dwarves had lost the battle, but not yet the war. In the end, victory would hinge on the success of their greatest fighter. However, Umangit wasn't the only high-level fighter. Suddenly, by his side appeared a man draped in white robes. On his back was a large symbol resembling the two large eyes of a dragon surrounded by complex spell formations. The Sovereign Church. General Umangit. I offer my assistance. Acolyte Bansfog. Umangit looked to his side, seeing the draped acolyte of the church. This acolyte was a dwarf but unlike other dwarfs, kept a very reserved and proper appearance. Most of dwarven civility came from the teachings of the church, and these members were icons of those teachings. As for this Bansfog, although he was a tier 7 light mage, he wasn't educated in the more secret spells of the church. This gave him the lesser rank of acolyte and he primarily served the church and others as a very powerful healer. But he wasn't totally useless in combat and seeing everything that had happened, he also couldn't stand by any longer. After all, he too was a dwarf, and this stronghold could not fall. Umangit readily welcomed this capable assistant, and so, the two faced off against the artifact and five golems. Then, the general exploded with unprecedented power. Chapter 148, Titan Dirk watched from amidst the battlefield. He saw everything from the death of two marshals to the entrance of the general and the church's tier 7 light mage. But he never once acted out in order to help. And in all honesty, there wasn't much he could do against the golems. He might be able to hinder them somewhat, and there was no way he could be hurt by such predictable and slow giants. But killing them was another matter entirely unless he knew their weakness. However, he could in fact barely see what seemed to be their core. There was a complex amalgamation of earth mana within their bodies, and despite their bodies being entirely solid and unmoving, that core could frequently change positions. It was odd, like an animal that could freely change the position of its heart. 
but he didn't question it much. Such a high-level application of magic wasn't unexpected from a key artifact. However, it seemed that Yumangit was easily able to pick out these weaknesses. Because after he stepped out, he cast a series of spells that precisely targeted these cores. Yumangit didn't even need to cast anything in order to create something. Magic came as easily as breathing to him, and that made it almost like instant casting. In one moment, he was just sitting high in the sky. But in the next, Dirk saw five massive metal spikes appear around him. Each one was horribly compressed with dense metal mana, making his neck tingle. The spikes were then spun like a drill, and with a grunt, Umangit launched them toward the golems. Each of those spikes seemed to have been launched from a cannon as they made contact with the golems' bodies and pierced through like a knife through butter. But their collision created the horrible sounds of screeching metal, making everyone cover their ears and monsters scream out in discomfort. It was only for a moment though, because the next, four of the golems slowly collapsed on themselves, their cores accurately pierced and destroyed, the massive spikes sticking out of their bodies like spears. But one remained standing. It was the Alpha, the entirely metal golem that had been hardly injured by any of the marshals, and the one responsible for the first marshal's death. Umangit narrowed his eyes, realizing that, while he could destroy the golem as much as he wanted, the complexity of the enchantments within the golem made it incredibly resilient. How a mere tier 5 was able to construct such a monstrosity was beyond him. He raised his hand, intending to finish the job. But before he could cast a spell, the acolyte Bansfog stepped up. Allow me, General. Save your energy for the real enemy. Very well. He nodded as Bansfog cast a few other spells. Neither of these spells were aimed at the golem. Rather, they targeted the other marshals. Assist me. Yes. All the marshals re-entered the battlefield as the light of the acolyte blessed their bodies with newfound strength. Umangit allowed them to collectively bring down the metal golem, deciding that it was a good thing for them to redeem themselves for the death of their two brothers. That way, they could ease their minds and boost the morale of the army. But the cheers didn't reach Umangit. He was too focused on his true enemy. He faced off against the artifact that continued to stand tall atop its castle. It didn't react to the death of its golems. Unlike him, it didn't hold any sort of emotions, at least not that it acted on. But he could tell that it was focused, seeing him as an enemy. Umangit sensed the hostility but that didn't mean he understood why. Why was this thing attacking, and why now of all times? Umangit felt suspicious of the entire situation, especially because Feller had only recently been called back. It was the worst time for anything big to happen, and yet here this artifact was. But those were matters he couldn't focus on right now. Because right as he was about to cast some more spells, the artifact's metal castle suddenly collapsed. The entire structure morphed, folding in on itself and reforming around its body. Like that, Umangit watched as another golem was created. Except, unlike the plain golems that were only 60 meters tall, this one was identical to the artifact's suit of armor, and it was an even more colossal 100 meters tall. Umangit could tell that this artifact wasn't obscenely powerful. However, what it lacked in power was more than compensated for in sheer complexity. Its knowledge of the earth element seemed unrivaled as it created a construct that could move no differently from its own body. Then, it launched an attack. Across the giant armor, thousands of spell circles appeared, using its body as a conduit to launch from. And then, the same spikes that Umangit previously created were launched, except in much greater numbers. With a flurry of his sleeves, Umangit responded with several thousand spells of his own. Expect, all these spells created large flat disks which he used to intercept the spikes. And each one met its mark. It was like the artifact was shooting targets out of the sky, each disk nullifying the spikes and sending them limply to the floor where they killed hundreds of unlucky monsters. Umangit responded right after, his hand grabbing out toward the ground and his fist clasping as if grabbing something. Come, my domain of conquest. Rumble. It was as if the world responded to his words. The ground roiled as metal rose from beneath the earth, gathering en masse and forming the body of a titan. 
this titan wielded a large spear and shield, towering just as high as the artifact. And in mere moments, it pierced out with a thrust, the spear threatening to impale the artifact's chest. But it dodged with agility, turning its body until the spear could only slice its shoulder. But the slice was deep, and it was clear that this wasn't a mere battle of massive constructs. Dirk, who was near ground zero of this battle, could feel the fluctuations in the earth element the greatest. This was especially so since he was attuned to it. And the feeling left him suffocating. His control of the element vanished entirely, and if not for the strength of his soul, the earth mana within him would have been sucked out to fuel Umangat's creation. This level of control was something Dirk had never experienced before. The only thing he could compare it to was Eldritch Primordial barring him from wielding the Dark Element. But even that was so far beyond him that he couldn't really grasp what had happened. But Umangat's domain wasn't like that. It was well within his limits of comprehension and he could feel it affect him the instant it was created. It felt like Umangat had become king of the earth, and he had become nothing more than a lowly servant that couldn't defy the whims of his sovereign. It made him feel disgusted but there was nothing he could do. He wasn't even a tier 5 yet. How was he supposed to defy the full power of a tier 8, someone who stood at the top of the world's power hierarchy? But it was a valuable experience, helping Dirk affirm exactly why he needed to grow stronger. And because of this, he watched the battle intently. He could see more than just the massive constructs. In fact, those were only superficial representations of the true underlying spells that ran everything. Dirk could see Umangat's domain spread throughout the land, enveloping even the stronghold behind him. This domain allowed him absolute control of the earth. Every scrap of dirt, every metal in the ground, every pebble between the nails of the monster army. Nothing was beyond his reach, and he used this domain to suppress the artifact with absolution. The ground churned grabbing the heels of the artifact's construct and immobilizing it while the domain seemed to wrest control of anything the artifact was attempting to utilize. The level of elemental manipulation had Dirk's head spinning, because in an attempt to retaliate, the artifact was casting thousands of complex spells. All these spells filled Dirk's vision, threatening to blind him in an entirely different way. And its attempts weren't futile. Umangat wasn't able to usurp the artifact's construct. But he did tie it down and use his own titan to damage it, the blows threatening to sever the artifact in two. Looking back, Dirk questioned why he ever believed he could even have a chance against the artifact. It couldn't put up much of a fight against Jumangit. It could only delay, using sheer complexity to overwhelm the dwarf and force him to expend more energy. The artifact never had a chance at winning in the first place. But the fact that it could survive at all was astonishing. If Dirk had really felt its full power, he could only run like he had earlier. It far outclassed him. Of course, it also lacked variety. Earth magic was extremely defensive in nature and could be configured in many different ways, but in the end, everything you controlled was merely earth. It wasn't as malleable as water, not as free as air, and not as destructive as fire. It also didn't have the unique applications that light and dark had. It was simple, almost painfully so. Perhaps this was everything it had to offer when brought to an extreme, and at first glance, it seemed underwhelming. But, in any other scenario, Umangat's titan and domain of conquest would make him unkillable. He could bring an entire city crumbling down to its foundations with the wave of his hand. He was a walking disaster. It was a wonder how someone like that could ever be chained down. It was by no means underwhelming, and Dirk wondered if he would be able to fight these kind of battles one day. Of course, he would never be so flamboyant with his applications of such power. It simply wasn't his style. Regardless, this battle brought him vast inspiration, and at a perfect time since he wouldn't be able to advance further without bringing his tear up another level. This kind of learning was essential to his growth. Like that, the battle between two titans continued. It was basically a one-sided beatdown, but the artifact held on for as long as possible, using any means it could to delay the inevitable. And gradually, it started to fall. It was right as the Acolyte Bansfog and the Marshals finished taking down the Metal Golem that the artifact could no longer maintain its construct. 
the massive metal behemoth collapsed, almost as if melting down. Then, the artifact emerged, looking just as miraculous, but its aura far less imposing. Umangit discarded his construct as well, and when he appeared openly, he looked obviously haggard. That's when Dirk's heart pounded before slowing to a crawl. He suddenly received a message. Spite, who had gone to find Pandora, relayed a message from the princess. It is said that Umangit must load massive amounts of mana into his construct and domain. Now, he has discarded it all. The two have entered the final stage of battle. Be ready to retrieve the construct. I am preparing to enter. Dirk was silent as he processed the message. It seemed like, although Umangit was going to win, it would cost him a good deal of energy. In that case, he was only becoming more vulnerable. Dirk knew that emptying their mana pool took a toll on the mind. In that case, he knew that Umangit's reactions would be delayed and he wouldn't be able to muster spells as fast as he did before. All these things were advantages. Dirk only needed to wait for the best time. But that wasn't now. The battle had yet to end. Umangit stood across from the artifact. After taking a moment to recover, the artifact went back to casting spells. This time though, Dirk saw something that even shocked him. The artifact raised its hands, and from it, a massive spell formation was created. It was composed of an entire 21 layers of spell circles, each one compounding on top of the other with varying sizes and complexities. And the artifact poured copious amounts of mana into the formation. Baffling Umangit, it was giving everything it had with this one attack. And it wasn't an attack Umangit could take lightly. With the level of elemental complexity this artifact could wield, an attack of this scale would take multiple times the amount of energy from him to defend against. That's what such deep elemental knowledge afforded the artifact. So he mustered all his energy with a roar. In front of his body, a small fortification was created. It was a half dome that spread to his sides, one that would direct all the energy of the attack away. Because Umangit knew that, although he could tank a lot of it, the damage that spell could do to those behind him was a major issue. He was protecting not just himself with this fortification. And on the fortification appeared a 16-layer spell formation, one that Dirk saw increase the elemental density of the material by hundreds of times. The ground beneath quaked and cratered, the weight of these spells affecting the environment in catastrophic ways. This was especially so as the artifact's spell formation came to completion. Within the spell, a massive ball of metal appeared. At first it seemed like nothing, but then, the ball began spinning at extreme speeds. And then, Dirk actually saw the light around the metal ball warp. His own feet staggered as he felt a massive attractive force appear from that spell. My god. He couldn't help his astonishment as his stealth threatened to break. Gravity. This artifact was manipulating gravity. That metal ball was rotating so fast, carrying so much weight, that gravity bent around it. And the gravity of the surroundings was multiplied as well. Several monsters were sucked into the gravity well, and shockingly, all of them were unable to fight back as their bodies were shredded and compressed onto that metal ball, giving it a red tinge. Umangit cursed as the metal ball actually shrunk in size. The power behind this attack was beyond his understanding. Luckily, the artifact couldn't seem to keep this up, because moments later, the spell completed. Right at that moment, the acolyte Bansfog appeared to Umangit's side, casting his own spell. It released a beam of light, but that beam merely hurtled toward the ball before being slingshot away by the gravity and cratering somewhere else. Useless. Dirk smirked before bracing himself. The metal ball, what had now basically become a black hole, shot toward Umangit. H-H-H. He gave one final roar, and the black hole collided with his fortification. Boom. An explosion was released by the collision an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. These two colossal powers clashed, obliterating anything between them. Thankfully, Dirk distanced himself enough. But the fallout was still immense. The two spells continued to clash for several seconds, the power within that black hole being released in explosive emissions as it was broken down. 
but similarly, the fortification faltered and was shredded by that imploding power. And the surroundings were even worse as what seemed like a ravine was created between the two, permanently scarring the planet. However, the might of a tier 8 wasn't for nothing. In the end, the ball gradually dissipated, and even though the fortification was reduced to a paper-thin wall, it still held out in the end. The surroundings became quiet, not monster nor dwarf making a single sound. Umangit fell to one knee, his breathing labored. This, ha, is why I fight with large-scale spells. He lamented as his head broke out in a splitting headache. He was a mage who specialized in large-scale spells. It was why he was brought to this battlefield, because his powers could flourish the most when faced with huge amounts of enemies. It was also why he was paired with General Feller, because that meathead specialized in one-on-one -on -one battles. They made up for each other's weaknesses. But now, Umangit was forced to face off against an enemy who could use both large-scale spells and localized spells. Its power was efficient to a terrifying degree whereas Umangit's was quite the opposite. Of course, he wasn't a one-trick pony. He could utilize small-scale spells, but when faced with this level of complexity, he still lost out, making up for his weakness with sheer power. He barely stood up, looking toward the artifact that was faltering itself, running on fumes. But before he could move to capture it, he felt both the light and dark man around him fluctuate. Turning around, he was baffled to see the vampire princess and her positively maddening smile. Chapter 149, Slippery When he saw the princess, Umangit's bad feeling instantly multiplied. He realized there was something going on. His body was rapidly recovering, but it would still be some time before he could even think about casting anything complex. Not only that, but the artifact wasn't something that would just lay down and get captured. Suddenly, the suit of armor bolted off. Its direction, the stronghold. Ah! Get it! Pandora shouted, her hands conjuring a huge light spell and casting it. Like that, the entire battlefield was blanketed in white, nobody being able to sense any auras within. Then, amidst that white, a dark phantom suddenly appeared. It shot toward the armor that was running, a hand reaching out to stop it. But sensing that phantom, the artifact instantly cast a small spell that shot out a small rock and diverted the hand, letting it dodge and escape. Slippery. Dirk grunted, his hands stinging from the blow. But he still pursued, as did Pandora. She created chains of light that lashed out, wrapping around the armor and restraining it. Dirk also cast some earth magic, creating a large metal cage that boxed it in. However, just when it was about to be enclosed, the artifact burst with another dozen spells. Each of them were precisely targeted, and not only were all of Pandora's chains shattered, but Dirk's cage was taken from his control, morphing into a barrier that separated them from the artifact. Damn it. Dirk. I'm trying. He yelled back at Pandora's panicked shout. He really wasn't taking this lightly, but the artifact was truly as slippery as an oiled eel. Its control over earth mana was obscene, even if it was running low on fuel. So he kept trying. Instead of using light mana to bind it, Dirk cast some curses and used dark mana to restrain it. Pandora also used the fullest extent of her four elements. Water flooded the area and threatened to freeze the artifact in place while creating violent vortexes of air that tried to keep it from maneuvering. Dirk's restraints were successful. The curses inhibited the armor's movements, although it didn't seem to do much beyond that. After all, it was a suit of armor, not a living being that he could curse with pain or blindness. He also created chains of dark mana that bound the armor, utilizing the curses even further. These couldn't be broken so easily, so the artifact was actually brought to a halt. And then there was the water that flooded the area from Pandora. It softened the ground while scooping up the artifact. However, before they could do anything more to truly lock it down, the artifact let out another burst and sunk into the ground, disappearing from their sights. Shit! Stupid piece of junk! Scoop it up! Dirk yelled, compelling Pandora to focus. After a grunt, she clenched her jaw and waved her arms. 
Dirk did the same, and from both of them, earth mana surged, flooding into the ground. It resembled what Umangit had done, overturning the earth and creating a flood of dirt. All this material was pulled up as if by a giant pair of hands. And within that massive pile of ground, the artifact was digging around like a mole. Just then, it shot out of the floating pile and continued running into the distance. Dirk and Pandora gave chase. Into the side, Umangit watched them incredulously. It took him a moment to process. Technically, it looked like they were helping him subdue this adversary. But he knew that their intentions weren't so virtuous. They wanted to capture the artifact for themselves. This obviously meant it was extremely valuable, and he had naturally picked up on that as well from his battle. But, if his guesses were right, then they already knew about its value beforehand. And more than that, they knew what the hell it was in its origins. It was information he now needed, so he stood up with a flicker of rage and gave chase. Hey! Ah! The general is chasing us, Dirk. I see that. Keep your paws off my prey. Umangit yelled like an angry father chasing some unruly children. Unfortunately, just as the artifact was slippery, Dirk and Pandora proved themselves just as such. Dirk was able to void walk, slipping through any earthen bind Umangit tried to put him in. And Pandora eroded all his constructs with her water while shooting out of the enclosure with bursts of speed granted by her light magic. He couldn't capture either of them, and they continued to try and restrain the artifact. Like this, they ran around the battlefield for several minutes. Luckily, the artifact couldn't continue forever. It continued to get into precarious situations, the combined power of two geniuses constantly lashing out at it. But it didn't want to be chained down. It wanted to be free, and now it knew that Pandora, who had tempted it here, was only trying to chain it down further. It was desperate, and so while trying to escape, it looked for anything, something that could secure its future and freedom. And then, in the distance, it could sense something. A living being, but one whose body was riddled with the artificial power of metal and enchantments. It saw Exos, a young man whose body was augmented and fused with the earth itself. And more than that, from him, it could sense the desire to push further down his evolutionary path, reaching toward heights without being chained down by his own inherent weaknesses. It decided that it liked what it saw. While it had also seen Dirk and his pure soul and perfect earth and metal attributes, it realized that Dirk would only use it as a tool. He dominated everything with unyielding will, and that wasn't something the artifact wanted to chain itself to. It wanted freedom, not to be controlled absolutely. Pandora was no different from him. As for, Umangit, that man was already at his prime, his body and soul already set in its ways like a stone that had hardened for thousands of years, unable to be grown and molded into something unique. So given all the factors, it chose. The artifact expended the last dregs of its energy, utilizing gravity repulsion to distance itself from its captors and shoot straight for its target. Pandora could also see Exos. Why he was out on the battlefield was beyond her. She had found him and kept him with her during the battle, but had told him to sit still when she went out. Maybe he wanted to help me since I'm basically his sponsor. Shit. You just couldn't listen. She cursed in her mind, watching as the artifact slipped from between her fingers. And then, it collided with Exos. The two went tumbling, Exos obviously not having been ready. Pandora thought that it was going to harm Exos, perhaps killing him for some of his energy. But then, she saw a massive spell formation bloom from the armor. The sight caused her face to turn incredibly ugly, her visage churning in pure rage. Damn it! Stop that artifact! She screamed, and right as she did, Dirk shot forward with a void walk, appearing right next to the two. He also thought that the artifact was going to kill Exos, so he exploded with aura and reached out to pull the armor away with his newfound strength. But he was a step too late. The spell completed far faster than expected for how complex it was, and then, the armor turned to liquid. It fell under Dirk's grasp, washing over Exos' body and sinking into his skin. At that moment, Dirk became acutely aware of Exos' soul. That's because it was exposed by the completed spell. And like that, 
he could sense the two combined, the artifact melding into Exo's very being. Then, everything faded, Exos passed out and no artifact could be seen. Pandora stood to the side, her face far less beautiful than it usually was. Turning back, Dirk could see an aura of palpable rage brew around her, the light mana within her seeping out and turning red. He also felt a great pressure on his mind, her skills responding to her violent emotions. But Dirk could also see Umangit, who was closing in. They didn't have time to debate or get angry, so he made a decision. He grabbed Exos, slinging him over his shoulder before snatching Pandora by the arm and shooting off. Damn dwarf! Kill him! Get it back! Just shut up and work with me here! Dirk yelled back as Pandora threatened to cast some grand magic and kill Exos. Right on his tail, Umangit gave chase. Unfortunately, Dirk was using his full strength while Umangit was still drained from his battle. Damn boy! Come back here! Dirk naturally didn't respond, but Pandora's face twisted more before shooting Umangit a death glare. However, before she could open her mouth to respond with some of the most heinous remarks he could imagine, he swung her around before tossing her on a particular patch of dirt. Right when she hit the ground, a spell formation appeared as the nearby space fluctuated. The next moment, Dirk jumped into the range of the spell, a dark crystal glowing at its center. Umangit saw this and let out a roar, casting magic as fast as he could. You conniving thieves! Shut up, you filthy lard neck by dash! Flash! The completed spell interrupted the raging princess, and just like that, they vanished from the battlefield. Umangit's spells overturned the ground just a moment later, but when he realized it was too late, he let out one final raging roar. The white concealment around the battlefield also dissipated as he did so, and the entire stronghold was able to see their general roaring. However, they interpreted it differently. Seeing now enemy and their general being so passionate, they believed it to be a victory cry. So they joined, the entire dwarven army screaming to the skies in unison, and causing their unlucky general to smolder even further. Ack! Where is he? After landing on some barren ground, Pandora scrambled around. She quickly spotted Exos who seemed to have fallen into a coma. And with billowing rage, she cast a six-circle spell. A blood-red ice needle appeared in front of her palm, spinning and aiming right for Exos' head. But before she could fire it, Dirk appeared and diverted her aim, the needle shooting off into the sky. Hey! Stop! We don't know what killing him will do to the artifact. It's merged with his soul. I don't care. This dwarven dog stole our artifact. Killing him won't fix anything. We won't know unless we try. Pandora couldn't seem to hear Dirk in all her rage. Blinded by fury, she kept trying to kill Exos, but was stopped by Dirk. Eventually, she was tackled to the floor, but it did nothing to douse her anger. Just stop and calm down. Making rash decisions can make the situation worse. You know that. I don't care. If we kill him, either the artifact separates from him or it gets destroyed. I'm fine with both outcomes, because if we can't have it, nobody should. That's a variable we can't accept. Dirk wasn't sure what to say to this. No matter what, Pandora wanted Exos dead, and there didn't seem to be a single reason to stop her. At least, none that he immediately thought of. But when he spent some more time thinking, restraining Pandora all the while, he suddenly had an idea. The Source If that artifact gets destroyed, then we can't take control of the sources. Do you want to risk sabotaging our end goal when we've only just started this whole mission of ours? This time, Pandora was silent. Inwardly, she knew that this was the crux of the issue. The key artifact was more than just a powerful tool or boost in power. It was the key to the source. If that was lost, then they may as well drop everything and give up. But Pandora didn't want to believe it. Not only was she livid that someone had stolen what she believed was hers and foiled her plan, but that person would now receive a massive boost in power and pose a potential threat to them. It was a massive risk, and Pandora didn't want to hinge everything on whether Exos would be loyal to her in the future. 
and that wasn't even considering whether he would be able to control the artifact at all. So in a search for answers, she brought out the Book of Life, the golden pages flipping while she asked the question. Record, if we kill Exos, will the key artifact separate from him and still remain functional? Negative. The soul of the key artifact has bound itself to the soul of Exos Havilite. Killing Exos will result in permanent damage to the artifact's soul. Why do we need the soul of the artifact at all? Can it operate without it? Negative. The key artifact's soul is the conduit by which it can connect to the element. Without it, it is nothing more than an empty vessel, one that can only be filled by the expertise of the Earth Dragon Primordial. And any damage to it will render it unable to operate the source. Fuck! Pandora cursed, realizing there was no way out of this predicament. If she killed Exos, then the key artifact couldn't be used. While the record only said that the artifact's soul was bound to Exos, it was likely that it had bound to Exos in order to escape any other captors. If it was deliberate, then it was likely threatening Pandora with exactly what she couldn't allow to happen. And it knew that if she was smart enough to have the keys to undo its seals, then she knew exactly what its purpose was. The artifact was smart and did basically everything right in order to escape. Pandora could do nothing to it. Pandora quickly realized all this, of course. And it only fueled her rage that much further. She was a hair's breadth away from disregarding everything and killing Exos anyway. If he had just stayed put. Damned idiot. Why did he walk onto the battlefield? Why? Everything was going right. We were so close. The only thing worse than this would have been Yumangit getting his hands on the artifact and revealing its existence to the world. Dirk no longer restrained Pandora, letting her vent. He was just happy that the record kept her from killing Exos outright. However, this also spoke volumes about Pandora's true nature. Perhaps she was even worse than Dirk in regard to how she trusted people. Dirk didn't actually believe that she trusted anybody. Maybe he was the only one she could trust in this entire world, and he only came to believe this after many weeks of her basically being glued to him and threatening to marry herself to him. Toward anybody else though, she didn't have the slightest ounce of trust. She only trusted in her evaluations of their character, and all of her decisions that seemed to place her trust in their hands were merely calculated decisions based on what she knew they would do. Dirk was the only one she would give her blind trust to. Only he had earned her approval. It was why, besides a few directions and strategies for her plans, she basically let him have full autonomy. For everyone else, she would plan out their every move and minimize all possible variables and deviations. And she already spoke of the tools she utilized to do this. Threats, temptation, bribery, and dozens of other conniving tactics that she would use to funnel a person's actions down a certain path. In the past, these things always worked. Especially so on Earth. But here, she had finally tasted what it was like to lose because of a difference in power. The artifact was impossibly slippery. If they had been able to restrain it, then Exo's presence wouldn't have mattered. But it managed to survive just long enough to find an opportunity to escape their grasp. Neither Dirk nor Pandora had been able to use their power in order to secure that victory. Even Dirk was irked to no small degree. He hadn't ever failed like that, but it wasn't the failure itself that made him angry, but how it all happened. What the hell were those spells? The obscene level of elemental manipulation along with impossibly and precisely placed spells that shattered every form of restraint they had tried to place on it with the most minimal use of energy. Even Yumangit had lost to it, despite it technically being his victory. Because how was that supposed to be a victory? A tier 5 suit of armor with a soul had actually managed to fight him, a tier 8, to a standstill. It was humiliating. In fact, that precisely summed up the entire encounter with the artifact. It had humiliated all parties in a single battle before finding itself an acceptable host. How was that not a resounding victory on its part? Of course, Dirk didn't really think about all this. He was more concerned with the knowledge contained within the artifact and how he might be able to learn to be just as slippery. But, he could also understand why Pandora was as furious as she was. And considering her unique mind, 
he wasn't shocked when her emotions were elevated several levels. She vented to the side, and it seemed her rage only grew with every curse. She continued to think about everything, replaying everything in her mind and fuming over every single detail that led to their failure. She was naturally overthinking even the smallest details, and it led her down into a spiraling pit of absolute hatred. Pulling at her hair, randomly launching off huge spells. She continued to thrash around at the environment, almost hitting Dirk and Exos in the process. And then, she started to cry, her rage reaching such heights that it overwhelmed her. Ack! Stop hurting! Just shut up! She clutched her own body, dropping to her knees while heaving for breath. It was only at this point that Dirk finally decided that he might need to step in. But he was still confused. Just what was getting her so riled up? Was this the byproduct of her trait, mind of delirium? If it was that, he could understand a bit of heightened emotion, but this was a whole other level. Hey, Pandora. No. Just stop. Pandora. Feeling real worry, Dirk stepped in and grabbed her. She lashed out, but he wrapped her up with his arms, keeping her from doing something like launching a spell. They both went to the ground, Dirk locking her against his chest. She continued to fight, but it gradually died down. Instead, she just cried with wide eyes that couldn't seem to process her emotions. I almost had it. I shouldn't have failed. I know. It's okay. It's not. I can't fail. I don't know what to do. Just, stay with me, here. Dirk almost found himself pleading, not out of frustration but because he actually found himself worried for her. He didn't know why. It was just that her actions spurred something within him, filling him with concern that stemmed from something else other than fear for how she might go on a rampage or do something insane. When he saw her reacting so violently, and remembered why she was like that in the first place. When he heard her words about failing, how her entire emotional balance had been thrown into disarray because of one setback. Dirk couldn't help but understand. Because after all, they both had come from the same place, had gone through the same hell, and had come out as two twisted individuals who were the furthest thing from normal in any world. In their first life, Dirk had been lucky enough to be taken care of by a father figure. But she didn't have that. If anything, it was much worse for her who was turned insane and then mercilessly kicked to the curb. No royal status or endless riches could make up for what she had gone through back then. And for once, Dirk wished that she hadn't had to go through that. Even if not completely, he understood the pain she was showing him. What do I do? What do I do? Pandora continued to mutter, her breathing shallow and hurried as Dirk held her. And when he heard this, Dirk thought back. He remembered his sergeant, that blunt but caring man who taught him how to find purpose even when all seemed lost. And then, he thought about his mother, a woman who loved him unconditionally and taught him what it meant to rely on someone and give them your trust. Two figures who shaped who he was today. He called upon his experiences with both, and he decided to offer some of that to the woman in his arms. Look at me. Dirk spoke, and Pandora responded by raising her head. Her teary red eyes gazed into him, and now more than ever, Dirk was acutely aware of the deep connection they held through their soul. He hoped she could sense his sincerity through that connection. I'm here for you. It's okay if you fail. I'll be here to help you back up. You can trust me. Pandora was completely silent, continuing to stare at Dirk. Then, he watched as she suddenly passed out in his arms, her body falling limp. Pandora? Chapter 150, Trust. I'm here for you. Trust me. Ugh. Words echoed in Pandora's mind as she woke up, her mind gradually becoming lucid enough to open her eyes. Through her mildly blurry vision she could see the ceiling of the car, and underneath her mattress she could feel the rough terrain they were driving on. But as if realizing she had waken up, the car came to a stop. Dirk, who was driving, didn't look back even as everything went silent. In the passenger seat beside him, Pandora could see Exos laying there asleep. His breathing was shallow and unhurried, his head tilted oddly against the window. 
A while passed, and Dirk eventually spoke. Are you okay? Yeah. She responded after a moment, taking a few more seconds to process everything that had happened. The epic failure of their mission to capture the key artifact of Earth. The fact that it was now in possession of another person and unable to be separated from them without destroying it, opening up a slew of potential issues in the future regarding trusting that person and making sure they still followed along with her plans. Making enemies with Umangit, and for all intents and purposes, the entire dwarven haven. And then, Dirk's words of support, which had hit her harder than all the other things combined. When Pandora looked up and saw the side of Dirk's face, she felt her emotions stir out of control. When was the last time she had heard those words? In fact, it was more appropriate to ask if she had ever heard them at all. Now, not only did those words come to her, but they came from the last person she ever thought they'd come from. Dirk was the most reliable person in her life. She trusted in his ability blindly, trusted that if he said he would do something, then he would do it. She trusted that he wasn't like her who was capable of using people like mere tools to eventually discard them. She trusted in who he was as a person and who he had become in this new life. There was nobody that she trusted more, because she had a deeper relationship with him than anyone else. But she knew that he didn't trust her in the same way. There was still a barrier between them, one that he had created and one that she didn't believe would come down any time soon, if ever. But in that moment, when she was overtaken with hysteria after that cataclysmic screw-up, he had given her what she didn't even know she needed. Something she never had. Something that, if anything, had been taken away from her and crushed throughout her lives. Trust that stemmed from something more than just predictability. True trust, and someone who would support her physically and mentally when she needed it. Someone that would give her security when she was vulnerable. Even now she could barely process it. It was almost like she didn't want to believe that she was actually given someone else's trust, that Dirk had actually reached out to support her. And more than that, she wasn't able to deny that it was real. Their connection didn't allow her to. The failure, she could push through. It would take some time, but her hysteria would die down and let her mind settle. It had happened before and she knew she would settle, even if it didn't seem like it in the moment. But that? Dirk's words had hit her like a brick, and her mind shut down. Now, she wasn't sure what to do. The only thing her mind could focus on were the emotions that fluctuated wildly, leaving her in an odd state of happiness and fear. To Dirk though, Pandora's face was blank as she just stared at him. She didn't say anything else, so he didn't either. He wanted to know what had happened, and he also needed to know what their next steps were. They had managed to escape soundly, through no small effort on Dirk's part. But he didn't want to interrupt whatever she was going through. So for a while, they sat in silence. H. Hey. Pandora suddenly stuttered, breaking the silence. Dirk turned back in response, seeing what he could only describe as a weird, wriggling smile. D. Did you mean what you said? I can trust you. Yes? And you'll support me, even if I fail? Yes. Really? Yeah. Like, really? Yes. I seriously can. Ah. Uh. He he he. She started giggling oddly, reaching out and grabbing Dirk's arm. Feeling her pull him, he could only climb out of his seat and tumble onto the back mattress. After that, Pandora latched onto him, placing her face awfully close to his. That smile never left. If anything, it became just a bit more delirious. I'll trust you, Dirk. We'll trust each other. We'll help each other. I'll rely on your strength to help me through our journey. It'll be different from before. I'll do my best not to fail ever again, but if it happens, I'll wait for you to help me. Will you be there when I need you? Yes, I'll be there. Dirk answered back, but he couldn't help but feel weird about this whole situation. He had offered her what was given to him by figures like his mother. He was empathetic to her plight, realizing that the two weren't much different, and that she needed help. So he gave her his support. But this was not how he expected her to take it. He expected her to be a bit, cooler about it, not this emotional mess she was coming off as. 
but he also knew she was being vulnerable, and he knew how difficult that was for people like them. So he didn't betray it. When she calmed to her baseline, they could return to some form of normalcy. Meanwhile, Pandora continued to giggle, clutching Dirk's body as if overwhelmed by some form of happiness. It lasted quite a while, and never once did she let go. But after many minutes of laying there, Dirk finally sensed her calming down. Her hurried breathing slowed while she pulled away and looked straight at him. She stared at him, her pupils going from dilated to a bit more restrained. That's when he was finally able to sense that familiar aura, one of scheming and calculation, as well as confidence and assertiveness. But there was a glimmer of something more now, especially when she looked at him. Dirk couldn't quite put a finger on it, but he could tell that their relationship would be a bit different from now on. What he didn't expect, though, was her next action. Out of nowhere, her face doved down, planting her lips on his. It was quick, soft, Dirk not even able to react before she pulled away slowly and muttered. I'm never going to betray you, Dirk. Even if you don't understand why, just know that. Because if not for your clear hesitation, I'd be giving you a lot more than just a kiss right now. Her blood-red eyes gazed into his soul, and Dirk didn't deny what she said about his hesitation. However, her words spurred something inside him that he didn't think would come unless he didn't want it. His body warmed, his heart quickening ever so slightly, beating with a bit more force and vigor. Even Pandora seemed a bit surprised by his reactions, but she only gave him a tempting smile before pulling away. I need to cool off. She muttered before climbing through the car and exiting, stepping outside. Dirk took a few seconds before shaking his head and joining her. He slipped out the top hatch of the car, feeling a cool breeze hit his skin as soon as he did so. Then, Spite suddenly appeared in front of him, her cat form gazing at him with amused eyes unbefitting a cat. Flick. Ow. Oh. She recoiled from his flick, her paw brushing her head as if it really hurt. Dirk smirked before looking over, seeing Pandora stretching her body and taking several deep breaths. When she turned back toward him with a sharp glint in her eye, he knew she had really come back this time. How long since the battle? About 38 hours. I was asleep for that long? You and Exos both, yes. In fact, he hasn't shown any signs of waking up yet. Well, bonding with another soul isn't an easy process. I'm not surprised. She looked toward the passenger window, seeing Exo's figure and giving him an indifferent stare. What happened had happened, and there were no undoing things. Pandora accepted it, though she still wasn't happy in the slightest. Her gaze contained unconcealed hatred. She let out a sharp breath before closing her eyes. Whatever. Despite everything, our plans remain unchanged. Unfortunately, I won't be able to step foot into a dwarven city for quite some time, though that doesn't mean business can't conclude. I'll have to make some calls, because it won't be long before our railways connect and supply lines open. But all that doesn't mean we can't also proceed to our next objective. Where is that? The territory of the elves, the other world. It's a rather paradisical place I think you'll like. Of course, that's all depending on if they've been overrun with monsters. I doubt they've fared as well as the dwarves, so we'll have to go in expecting trouble. Then again, trouble gives us the leeway to move as we please, so it's not that unwelcome. Pandora bit her thumb with a smile, causing Dirk to smirk a bit. That was the Pandora he knew, taking advantage of chaos in order to get what she wanted. Perhaps only with her methods was it possible to do the insane things she did. Although Dirk didn't like the insanity, he had to give respect to the results. After all, despite how things ended with the key artifact on that dwarven battlefield, it was only because of her direction that they were even able to get the chance to capture it at all. It would have been outright impossible if they had to do it alone. But, that also made Dirk think about how they would deal with things for the next key artifact. Would they have to borrow someone's strength again? That surely wouldn't end as well, not unless they got more powerful. Well, all their issues could be solved with power. Remembering that, Dirk decided that he would use more of his time to train his magic. He couldn't train his body any further until his mana heart caught up, so that was his greatest priority. But first, we should stop by Horizon. 
Pandora suddenly spoke again, climbing back into the car. Dirk followed her in confusion. Why? Well, I know you probably want to see your family. I can't exactly be as high profile there with the Emperor around and all, but that doesn't mean we can't pop in for a bit and say hi. I also want to know the situation. And in the best case, I intend to acquire a more advanced mode of transportation. What are you cooking in that brain of yours? Dirk looked at her oddly, feeling another scheme brewing that would no doubt get them into trouble. She just smiled and shrugged. Just trust me. It's for the greater good. And I doubt they're using it for anything worthwhile. It's really just a big paperweight that they use to show off. Dirk went silent. He had a feeling he knew what she was trying to do. Did he agree with it? Not really. But if he was being honest with himself, he also didn't enjoy being cramped inside this car all the time. Especially not now since Exos joined their group. We're really making enemies with everyone, huh? It was bound to happen. Now let's get going. Use this free time to advance your magic. Pandora pushed him into the back seat while taking the wheel, speeding off along the road they were on. In his escape, Dirk had taken some roads away from the stronghold, so they weren't in the middle of nowhere. In fact, they could drive to the dwarven capital in a day or so if they wished. So Pandora found her way back onto a regular trail. However, her path deviated a bit at some point, her destination unknown. Dirk didn't mind, just focusing on his magic. Like that, a week passed. The Mana Heart Technique In the beginning stages, it had its user create mini hearts for each element, each mini heart being an equal mix of the element alongside its specialty attribute. Up until Tier 4, the entire cultivation process was the creation and strengthening of these mini hearts. But, going beyond Tier 4 required one to truly comprehend the significance of the Mana Heart. The Mana Heart technique, according to its creator, was made for those with several attributes. It was best used by those with the legendary four attributes, but realistically, it was used by those with three attributes. The fact that it could even be created with such obscene prerequisites at all was a testament to its capabilities and quality. However, it was equally difficult. Before, Dirk hadn't had much difficulty advancing at all. He just needed to condense and store mana of various types. It required him to have basic understandings of his elements, but nothing beyond that since his pure soul could compensate greatly. He had basically brute forced his way to tier 4. But all that stopped as soon as he was forced to move past that. Tier 5 could only be reached by combining all the mini hearts into the one true mana heart. But this wasn't simply shoving all those mana pools together and expecting them to get along. Instead, it required one to learn how to shift from one element to another. In practice, it required Dirk to learn how to turn earth mana into metal mana, metal mana into fire mana, fire mana into lightning mana, lightning mana into dark mana, dark mana into earth mana, and every combination in between. In the end, his mana heart would be able to shift into any element he desired. It would be one singular massive mana pool, doing away with individual pools that could limit his options during battle. What this implied was that all mana was the same, that every element stemmed from the same source, and that they all had similarities that would allow them to turn into one another. And Dirk would need to comprehend all of this through the magical world of the mana dimension. However, there were two glaring issues that Dirk didn't know if he was able to reconcile. First was how each element had its own source. The source was literally the source of an element and all its mana throughout the world, and the fact that there were multiple sources meant that each was different. They shouldn't be the same thing and shouldn't be able to become each other. So either Dirk was misunderstanding something, or the mana heart technique was useless past this point. Second was how Dirk's dark mana heart wasn't sourced from atmospheric mana, but from actual source mana. How this would affect his mana heart, he didn't know but it would likely force him to improvise a bit. Creation of the mana heart would make him a tier 5, and the speed at which he did so entirely relied on his comprehensions. It could be fast or slow, happening all at once or gradually over several months. He naturally didn't want to take so long to do so, but he had a feeling this wasn't something he would be able to conquer in a short few weeks either. 
luckily, there was a lot of guidance for each of the elements within the Mana Heart Technique texts. Dozens of pages, each with deeply complex runic formations that cause the surrounding mana to fluctuate just by being exposed. And as always, Dirk's first order of business was tracing all these runes. He and Spite spent just about every waking hour doing this, and there was a good reason for it beyond having all the runes archived in his mind. Being able to recall all the runes exactly as they were written in the book allowed Dirk to utilize them while in the mana dimension. That dimension, which brought forth the greatest attunement to the elements, could allow him to comprehend the runes much faster. And this all compounded with his pure soul, resulting in shockingly fast speeds. At times, Dirk felt like he was reading a regular book while going through the runes. Of course, each runic page brought forth amounts of data that eclipsed normal books in every way. So at this point, Dirk's most valuable resource was time. And he got quite a bit of it thanks to Pandora who drove the entire way to their destination. Chapter 151, Wake. Mmm. -hmm. Oh? Pandora glanced to her side. There, Exos's body shifted in his seat, a low grunt escaping his mouth. Her eyes turned momentarily cold before she spoke. Dirk. Exos is up. Dirk was quiet for several seconds as Exos turned lucid, looking at his surroundings. But eventually, Dirk left his trance, returning to the real world and glancing at the dwarf in the passenger seat beside Pandora. Exos was silent as he looked around, seeing Pandora's beautiful face and staring for a few seconds longer than he should have. Then, he turned, seeing Dirk gazing from behind. After that, he closed his eyes for several more seconds, processing everything that had happened. Where are we? Driving. Our destination is the Dark Kingdom. Oh. Now, how about you tell us exactly what happened to you? Pandora's voice seemed concerned, but there was a slight hint of hostility that she could barely control. She had discussed with Dirk on how they would handle Exos. Seeing as he was now bound to a key artifact, losing his trust by being openly hostile wasn't a good plan. The key artifact was useless unless it was being used by someone. If they locked Exos up, keeping him caged until they needed him and the artifact, then the artifact wouldn't be able to unlock its seals and would be useless even when Dirk and Pandora had the power to use it. And if they turned Exos into an enemy, then that came with several other issues like him threatening their lives with the power bestowed to him by the artifact. Since it was the key artifact of Earth, killing him would likely be impossible by anyone who couldn't overwhelm him with absolute power. So not only did they need to keep him as a friend, but they needed to deepen their relationship. They needed his trust. They also needed to bring him with them, first to keep him within their control, and second to grow his power and allow him to undo the artifact seals himself. What used to be a duet between Dirk and Pandora had turned into a small group project. The three of them would need to travel the rest of the world and attain the other keys. The only blessing here was that Exos wasn't incompetent. He was an accomplished enchanter who had pioneered biological, magical, and mechanical augmentations. He pursued strength as much as the advancement of his craft, so along with the boost in power granted by the key artifact, he wouldn't be a burden. Pandora listened intently to the details of Exo's changes. When Exo started to explain what happened to him though, they were quickly surprised. You two were looking for the artifact this entire time, right? How did you know? Pandora narrowed her eyes. She could think of several ways Exos could deduce that information, but she was still a bit wary. He scratched his head. When I merged with the artifact, I could see its more recent memories. It remembered seeing Dirk when he first appeared near it on the battlefield. I can only assume that you guys were looking for it in the first place if you had deliberately gone to find it. It also remembers you being impossible to catch, even with its magic. H.M. Dirk smirked, somewhat appreciating the compliment since it had come from the artifact that he also couldn't catch, even given their advantageous circumstances. Pandora barely held back a scoff. Still, she was glad to know that Exos was likely aware of everything that had happened on the battlefield, including her own hostility. But if there was anything she was good at, it was manipulating people's emotions. 
she could play the part of the perfect princess as well as the most heinous devil, eliciting whatever response or impression she wanted from those she interacted with. Unlike with Dirk, gaining Exo's trust wouldn't be difficult for her. So you know the general situation. We are indeed looking for artifacts like the one you now have. That was the first one we followed a lead to. But more importantly, what kind of changes occurred within you? I can't imagine that the bonding process gave you nothing. No. In fact, it gave more than I could ever imagine. Exos could barely seem to withhold his excitement as he let out the details. Just by merging with it, I've learned so much about the earth element. It's like everything I've comprehended up until now was filled with massive holes and gaps. Not only has all that been filled into its utmost, but everything I thought was correct has now been perfected, and I've even glimpsed deeper into its nature. However, the artifact was limited as soon as it bonded with me, and the comprehensions I know only rose to the tier 6 level. I also need to assimilate a lot of the knowledge, which will take some time, especially in regard to my enchanting. But even at this moment, I'm far more powerful than I was. That sounds wonderful. Pandora almost shuddered in agony and rage hearing about everything that had been given to Exos, and more importantly, taken from them. But she held it down. Surely it couldn't get much worse than this. Oh, I also gained a new stigmata. It's the artifact itself, specifically as it manifests with its armor. It's exceptionally powerful. I doubt anybody even a level above me could ever kill me in a fight. Plus, it acts as the perfect conduit for magic. It's even integrated with the augmentations of my body, enhancing everything about my constitution. Ha <laughs> ha! How amazing! Pandora laughed, but Dirk could practically taste the utter madness within that threatened to burst forth. He was pretty sure Pandora was doing everything she could to not kill Exos where he stood. It was just a good thing the target of her anger didn't notice. Knowledge and the armor. Those two things were the primary benefits Exos received from the artifact. Everything else was minor details that Exos himself didn't even completely understand yet. Now, Pandora had a good read on just how powerful Exos was. But to her great displeasure, he was likely just as, if not more powerful than she and Dirk. This would only get worse as he got used to his power. So they needed to advance their power, and quickly. Pandora decided that it was time to stop holding back her own. She had spent enough time solidifying her power level. But first, they needed to reach the Dark Kingdom. Like the time it took to reach the Dwarven Haven, the drive to the Dark Kingdom took around three weeks. And in that time, Dirk had traced just about all the runes associated with developing his mana heart. Just doing that represented a high level of magical comprehension, one that he was surprised to have reached. Dirk had spent a long time improvising and developing his own magic, forcing him to comprehend the secrets of his elements and find applications for them in the form of techniques. Most of his magic came in the form of elemental manipulation, like stealth, his lightning body amplification, and even his mana sight. He very rarely learned new spells anymore. However, all the self-teaching had led to him having an exceptional ability to learn new things about his elements. And now, his mana heart technique was guiding him down a path of elemental comprehension. After stepping foot on it, Dirk found it surprisingly easy to follow along. Of course, he hadn't been comprehending the runic pages of the technique in full, just tracing them. But to trace them at all required a certain level of understanding. After all, you needed to be able to see something in order to trace it. And unlike books, runic pages had information so deep that you weren't guaranteed to be able to comprehend what you were looking at. Either way, Dirk was beginning to see what Pandora had meant when she said that their pure souls were the best for absorbing elemental comprehensions. He was very aware of his soul and the mana dimension, allowing his comprehensions to flow far smoother than otherwise. He could see things others couldn't. He was thinking that, unlike in the past, maybe this advancement wouldn't take so long. Of course, he couldn't give a good estimation before he really dove in deep. But those three weeks were extraordinarily valuable. Tracing all those runic pages would set him up in the future, laying the groundwork for what would hopefully be explosive growth. However, he wasn't the only one who had been working hard. 
Exos brought them no small amount of surprises. Dirk and Pandora knew Exos was an enchanter. His enchantments allowed his augmentations to work properly, bringing together the mechanical body of a limb and the mana crystals within it, forming a cohesive whole that could operate alongside the physical body. All of this required enchanting, but they didn't realize just how complex Exos' works were. They first got a glimpse of it when he brought out a prototype he had been working on. It was an arm, but instead of the current arm he had equipped, this one wouldn't just connect to his shoulder but replace everything up to his chest and shoulder blade. It was meant to be a direct upgrade, but he hadn't been able to get very far since he had been running low on funds. Exos had to not only order all the parts of his augmentations to be forged by someone, but had to buy custom potions that allowed him to carry out the augmentations. That wasn't even considering the mana crystals needed to both power the limbs and create the enchantments. His projects were expensive, which was why he had accepted Pandora's sponsorship so easily despite her being a vampire. Money and resources were the two things he needed the most. At least it was in good hands. When Dirk saw the prototype arm, he couldn't help but gawk. Exos even brought out diagrams for his enchantments. It was his pride and joy, something Dirk likened to a grimoire. In his hands appeared a huge magic book filled with large pages covered in enchantments and runic formations. They were all enchantments that he had personally created. In fact, it could be likened to an entire enchanting language that he devised himself. It was rooted in complexity, and after hearing some explanations, Dirk realized that Exos was basically coding magic with these enchantments. It was like he created a computer language. When Pandora took a look at everything, she too thought of that. Of course, she knew much more about technology than Dirk, so she was able to make better judgments. But even in her eyes, it was shocking how closely Exo's enchantments resembled computer code and software. Which, when considering the items he was enchanting, was only appropriate. The augmentations required a slew of instructions that made them no different than a program. Otherwise, there was no way Exos could make them operate just like normal limbs. Even Earth had only just started to do such things, and from that ability came the super soldier programs that brought deep cybernetic integration. But Exos had pioneered a similar path all by himself through magic. In short, he was a genius and that genius seemed to flourish under the influence of the key artifact. With his newfound knowledge, Exos worked tirelessly throughout the three weeks of their drive in order to reconstruct his understandings. This effort was primarily directed toward enchanting, making his work jump in complexity by several magnitudes in a short time. Of course, this was aided in two external ways. First were Pandora's resources. With a treasure trove of mana crystals and equipment, Exos had no inhibitions and started nothing short of an entire project within the truck. And secondly, Pandora actually gave Exos knowledge on computer science from Earth. While she wasn't an expert on that particular topic, Pandora was no less of a genius who knew all kinds of things from Earth. So she gave this applicable knowledge to Exos, opening up a whole new world to him and giving him all sorts of revelations and inspirations. When he wasn't discussing or learning things from Pandora, he was in a trance, utilizing everything he knew to refine his enchanting language. Dirk found it amazing that she would do such a thing, because if Exos wasn't already a monster after getting the key artifact, he would become one with futuristic knowledge. She was making him even more dangerous. But perhaps that was part of gaining his trust, in which case, Pandora was doing exactly what she needed to in order to succeed alongside Exos in the long run, and she was doing it perfectly. It was only unfortunate that Pandora was also the only one not to improve by leaps and bounds throughout that time. But she didn't seem to mind. Well, at least not outwardly. When it came time to sleep, her stress seemed to rear its head, and her coping mechanism seemed to be alone time with Dirk and his tasty blood. It was a bit embarrassing to Dirk since Exos was also there being a third wheel, but she didn't seem to care as she glued herself to him when night came. And that was how all three weeks passed, and by the end, they were rolling into the capital of the Dark Kingdom. Chapter 152, Grandpa Finally. Let's see if we can't get in and out before my mother comes and places me under house arrest. 
Pandora spoke while jumping out of the truck, stretching her limbs with a cute squeal. Dirk climbed out similarly, taking in the sights around him. They were within the central plaza of the chained capital city of the Dark Kingdom. Now more than ever, Dirk could feel the dark mana flooding all corners of this city and keeping it afloat through gravitational repulsion. In fact, if he wanted, he felt like he could ride this repulsion and reduce his own weight, even though he had never used gravity magic before. Three weeks of pure magical study and immersion had done a lot for Dirk's comprehension into all his elements. He had especially utilized the lightning crystal from the lightning dragon Uvos, one that was filled with nothing but pure information on the lightning element. So this is the Dark Kingdom. It's an amazing place. Exos muttered as he emerged as well. This was a completely new land to him, not to mention it being the capital of another empire. Like Dirk, he was overwhelmed by the sights and natural wonders. Pandora ignored him though. She seemed slightly hurried, and Dirk understood since she had just spent three weeks driving. They really couldn't get to their destinations fast enough. Hopefully that would change soon though. Even Dirk was having a change of heart in regard to her plan at Horizon. Better than it's sitting around. Besides, I've always had access to the best tech. Not exactly used to carting around slowly. He thought as they all entered the spire at the center of the city. Here. Suddenly, Pandora threw a ring at Dirk. Inside was a sheet of paper along with a large batch. I need you to go to the treasury and grab everything on that list. The seal inside the ring will be enough to get you wherever you want. Ask the doorman to help you too. We need to move quickly. Okay. Meet me back in the plaza when you're done. Exos, you come with me. With a wave, Pandora beckoned Exos along. He followed with curiosity, and Dirk branched off on his own. He walked down a few pathways, Spite jumping out and guiding him in her cat form. Then, they arrived at a long hallway. From its entrance, Dirk could see a large set of doors at the end. He walked with measured steps, and as he did so, his mana sight was locked on the man beside the doors. He was an old man in basic robes who sat in a seat, his body slumped over and his hand resting on a spear beside him. That old man didn't move at all, but Dirk's neck felt tingly as he got closer. He knew something was up with this old man, but he wasn't exactly interested in entertaining other people. He was eager to get to Horizon since he wanted to see his mother, and that meant he wanted to move just as quickly as Pandora. Dirk stopped in front of the doors, facing the old man who had yet to react to his presence. Last time, Dirk directly walked through these doors without so much as a word. In fact, last time there had been two other guards here, not this old man. Taking out the royal seal of the Dark Kingdom, Dirk waved it before the old man. I'm here on Princess Pandora's authority. There was no response, making Dirk unsure of what to do. The old man didn't so much as look up. Seeing the lack of response, Dirk let out a small sigh and stepped forward. I'll be entering. He said that while reaching out toward the doors. But right as he did, he could see the old man's spear lower down, as if to block his entrance. Only, the spear moved fast. More than that, it carried with it an odd power that made it flicker in Dirk's mana vision. The hairs on his neck stood on end, as if this spear were out for his head despite it not actually traveling toward his neck, only his outstretched hand. He could see it almost in slow motion. The spear's end flickered through space, making it seem like a slideshow of images. And he reacted on instinct, not so much as needing to think before doing so. His wrist moved, his elbow bending at an angle parallel with the path of the spear. The lightning mana in his body sparked at the same time, causing his movements to be explosive, almost uncontrollably so. But it was only with that speed that he could move as he needed to. The shaft of the spear just below its blade collided with his forearm, deflecting and redirecting all the momentum away from his body. And using that impact, the rest of Dirk's body spun around, his heel arcing toward the old man's head. From Dirk's heel came a spike of metal, lightning, and darkness. The darkness for the curse, the lightning for its speed, and the metal for its lethality. It was even laced with his aura. But just before that spike could pierce through the old man's head, he moved, 
and it landed just next to him. Cling. Everything froze as the blows were delivered, Dirk and the old man not making another move, but absolutely prepared to do so. Finally, the old man smiled, his squinted eyes looking toward Dirk from beside his foot. Funny. Usually a warrior can sense on instinct whether someone has the intent to continue fighting. But I can't sense that from you. I feel nothing, in fact. If anything, there's only focus. You're a curious young lad, hm? Not curious, just trying to grocery shop. Heh, <sighs> that's one way to describe raiding the royal treasury. He chuckled before retreating. His movements were cautious, as if making sure to be predictable in case Dirk would mistake him for delivering another blow. Dirk also pulled away, a new hole in the wall clearly visible. Jvana won't be pleased with the repair bill. Oh well. Jvana? My daughter. Now tell me, who exactly does my granddaughter plan to destroy next? The old man spoke while standing and opening the treasury doors, allowing Dirk inside. He followed, realizing just who this man was and who he was talking about. She plans on securing some faster transportation. Heh, I offered that to her a while ago. Unfortunately she doesn't enjoy receiving gifts unless it's customary to. Apparently she abhors the idea of being in debt to someone. From the perspective of a politician, she does everything correct, almost too well. But I'm her grandfather. She can't seem to separate family from politics, as if who we are and what we do are a weakness to her. Here. The old man plucked an item off a shelf, tossing it to Dirk. Dirk couldn't help but frown a bit, realizing this was one of the items on the list he needed to get. The old man smiled, reading Dirk's mind. Look deep enough into the concepts of space, young man, and you can pluck valuables straight out of pocket rings. Saying that, he waved around the list that used to be inside Dirk's ring. In front of that, Dirk could only sigh and follow along as he went and grabbed everything on the list. Some items were pens, some were odd devices, others were giant boxes of valuable mana crystals and beast skins. Anything in the treasury was valuable, and they really seemed to be rating it with how many things on the list there were. And all the while, Pandora's grandfather spoke. I wish that girl would learn to rely on her family more. It's like she thinks she's all alone, fighting everyone from every angle as if everyone were scheming for her downfall. Unfortunately, she's also concerningly good at what she does, so she can't learn her lesson through failure. Well, I figured out a while ago that she got the best from both worlds. Her mother's beauty and power alongside her father's intelligence and elemental affinities. Such a perfect girl. I only wish she could actually learn to enjoy her time rather than spend it in the hateful world that is royal competition. Then again, I only learned to do that in my old age. Blaming her would be rather hypocritical. He scratched his head, and behind him, Dirk's curiosity reached a tipping point. He didn't know much about Pandora's family. She was only one child of the queen. There were other princes and princesses. But Dirk hadn't seen or heard about any of them. And he especially hadn't heard about anything regarding what should be the vampire king, the husband of the queen and the father to all the royal children. Dirk felt that this grandfather was telling him all this for a reason, perhaps because Dirk was known to be close with Pandora for reasons nobody else could fathom. So he also felt that his next question wasn't unwarranted. Who is Pandora's father? A common man who became not so common through his wit and strength. He rose up from nothing across the span of nearly 200 years before establishing himself as one of the most powerful vampires to walk the world. Unfortunately he was also the most vicious. If you ever stop by the hybrid empire unity, ask around about the city of Bobiner, the third largest city of that empire. It's now an uninhabitable zone ravaged by heinous blood mana and curses, but still a valuable training ground for any daring dark magi. Right. Dirk started to understand why this man wasn't the vampire king. Not because of power, but because of image. But that begged another question. Where is he? Who knows? He disappeared alongside Emperor Horizon a couple decades ago. And unlike the Emperor, he hasn't re-emerged except in private to give my love-struck daughter more children. 
not that he would be openly welcome here. Regardless, most of the royal children have never met their father. Hmm. Dirk nodded, but he also felt weird about this gossip which was no doubt a tightly kept secret even among the nobility. Not that this made it shocking. Dirk was no stranger to deep dark secrets kept among very powerful people. Finally, the grandfather grabbed the last item. Dirk was glad that he didn't have to dig around for everything, and also got to hear some juicy history. It seems Pandora was the black sheep of her family with how amazing she was. But it also seemed that, even though she already had it, her scheming mind was technically inherited from her father. And if the vampire queen was a love-struck fool like her father said she was, then did Pandora inherit that too? Dirk sure felt like there was an inkling of obsessive romanticism that she carried considering how close she clung to him. It seemed that, although they came from a different world, their traits weren't completely set in stone, and some were passed on by their parents. Or they were given parents that matched their traits. Perhaps a combination of both. Here you go, lad. Dirk was handed the ring that now contained piles of valuable items. He nodded to the old man. Thanks. Sure thing. Just take care of my granddaughter. I don't know what kind of history you two have, but just that fact alone testifies to its extraordinaire. She doesn't seem to trust anyone other than you. I just hope you can come to reciprocate that. Throughout many years, I've come to know that despite her rather, delirious tendencies, she's a good person. It just takes someone who is willing to dig beneath that shell and see it. Someone willing to give her the love she wants. Dirk could sense a hint of sorrow and melancholy within his words, and he didn't take them lightly. Although he had known Pandora across two worlds, he wouldn't dismiss the words of a man who had watched her grow up. Doing that would be like saying that his own mother didn't know what kind of person he was, when she surely did after caring for him since he was a vulnerable child. It seemed, like him, she really did change. At least, on the inside she did. Outwardly, she still occasionally reminded him of that psycho from Earth. Now go on. Although dark kingdom ships are faster, Horizon surely wins out when it comes to traversing large distances especially when there's lots of cargo. Just make sure to get a pilot. And a maid. My granddaughter surely isn't going to clean things herself. In fact, she should be bringing her personal maid. Oh well. Shrugging, he led the way back out of the treasury. The doors closed behind them, and they walked through the hallway before coming to junction where they would separate. Before doing so though, Dirk asked. What's your name? My name is Corona Venzvanades, former king of the Dark Kingdom and a bona fide spear king. If you ever want to learn the spear, you can come to me. But I can already tell you're not the type to wield such a high profile weapon. I'm sure you think it flamboyant, hm? Heh. Dirk smirked. He did indeed think it was a bit flamboyant. It was too extravagant for someone like him who preferred to be sleek and subtle. He was an assassin, not a general or king. Quaron waved. Go on now. My daughter can only be held up for so long. If she knew Pandora was here, she would probably place her under house arrest. So you better hurry. Oh, and do try to avoid my grandson at the entrance. All right. Thanks. Call me Gramps. I don't know if I can. Dirk muttered before suddenly disappearing, shuttling through space and leaving the hall. Coron laughed, watching Dirk the whole way before vanishing himself. Unlike Dirk though, there wasn't the slightest ripple, as if he simply vanished from existence. Dirk gawked at the sight. He hadn't detected the slightest hint of mana on that man, but it seemed that didn't stop him. Using stealth and void walking, Dirk made his way through the spire before going for the exit. There, though, stood a young man. He was tall with dark purple hair, similar to Pandora's. On his back was a spear, and he stood around with wary eyes, looking for something. Dirk waited at a distance for a while. And not long later, he spotted Pandora walking out with Exos. She seemed surprised when she spotted the young man, but still walked forward as if she didn't care. Leaving the spire, she spoke. Karen, what do you want? Not you. 
I'm looking for your boyfriend. Well, he's been nearby for a while now. Seems you need to work on your sensory skills, because he would've long had your head. Bullshit. Heh, dumbass. She snickered and moved on, retrieving the truck from her ring. Come on, Dirk. You unfortunately can't hide from me, so stop trying to put your cat on my head. Eh, no fun. Dirk suddenly appeared, spite in his hands and held over Pandora's head. The cat looked resigned with her paws dangling and about to dig into Pandora's purple hair. Not like I want to touch you either, but I'm merely a toy for my master to use as he pleases. Stop making it sound so weird. Dirk shook his head and slung the cat over his shoulders, boarding the truck with the others. And while they drove away, Karen, the second prince of the Dark Kingdom, stood there with bulging eyes and clenched teeth. Chapter 153, Impaired We're going to take a teleporter to one of our border camps. After that we'll have to drive to the Horizon capital. But since we're saving a lot of time with the teleporter, it shouldn't take more than a week to arrive. And this time, you get to drive. Fine. Dirk readily agreed. He already appreciated Pandora driving them for as long as she did, so he didn't mind getting them to Horizon. Besides, he was sure that she wanted to work on her magic as well. Now that they had grabbed everything they needed from the Dark Kingdom, there shouldn't be anything keeping her from advancing her power. Pandora drove to the edge of the outer city beyond the chain capital. It was there that they stopped, particularly in front of a large teleporter nexus. The place was relatively crowded, and the building that housed all the teleporters covered as much ground as a magic academy. It was there that they met up with somebody. Not a soldier, but a woman. And she was dressed in a maid's dress. Dirk, meet my personal maid, Nova. She's a few years older than me and was assigned to me at birth. You could say we're sisters with how we grew up together. She'll be traveling with us. Dirk was silent as he observed this maid. She was a bit taller than Pandora, and unlike Pandora, had a bit more of a petite build. She was cute, if anything, with short hair that seemed to be cut that way for practical reasons. But Dirk could sense a sharp aura from her. It made him smile a bit, because he recognized it so clearly. The training of an assassin, someone skilled in the art of subterfuge. It seemed the personal maids or butlers of the royal family were there to do more than just clean up food scraps. And in this world of power, perhaps only powerful people were allowed to serve the powerful. And it seemed Nova could sense the same thing in Dirk, because he could sense her wariness toward just about every action he made. The slightest twitch of his finger made her focus shift, her body tightening as if getting ready for battle. Then, Dirk put his hand out. As he did so, her breath became shallow, until it stopped in front of her. Nice to meet you, Nova. She remained silent, staring at his hand for a few more seconds before realizing what he was doing. Then, it was like her etiquette kicked in as she hastily accepted the handshake. And nice to meet you, sir. Sir? I'm pretty sure I'm younger than you. Just call me Dirk. I understand, Dirk. Heh. Dirk couldn't help a chuckle as the girl bowed, to which Pandora rolled her eyes. Stop scaring her. Now let's go. Right this way, my lady. A train is awaiting your presence. Taking the lead, Nova led them through the terminal and toward a particularly high-class train. They boarded without pause, and before long, were already moving. Inside the train, Dirk found an entire bar, dining facilities, and all other kinds of comforts. This was definitely a first-class train. We should be there by night. Do whatever you want until then. I'll be inside one of the cabins. Pandora spoke those words before disappearing into one of the many rooms of the car alongside her maid. My lady. Hmm. Nova asked when the door to the room closed, Pandora responding while taking a seat on a bed. Nova took a seat behind Pandora, beginning to gently brush her purple hair with her sharp nails. Pandora accepted it with a pleased smile. Dirk Strider. He's dangerous. I know. You were practically oozing anxiousness. That's unlike you. I apologize, my lady. It's fine. 
if there's anybody you can compare to, it's him. Although not nearly to the same degree, you both went through similar experiences and training. That also means you should recognize the kinds of things he's capable of. In front of that, it's no wonder you lost your cool. Yes. Nova nodded, recalling the things she felt while confronting Dirk. Well, it felt like a confrontation to her. But she could tell that he was nothing but relaxed. It was like he had her in the palm of his hand, could kill her at any time. There was simply no need to fear someone who couldn't threaten you in any way. She understood that. It made her incredibly uncomfortable. As a maid, she was there not just to serve Pandora, but up to a certain level, protect her. Against Dirk, she was utterly incapable of that, so it left her with a bad feeling. And beyond that, the feeling of helplessness in front of him made her clench her teeth. After a few moments of silence, Pandora spoke again. Nova. I didn't bring you with me so that you could fight for me or protect me. I brought you so that you could help me with the lesser tasks that need to be completed. The battles we will be encountering in the future aren't something you can affect. Still, having you nearby is a comfort. Can I rely on you for that? Always, my lady. I'll be by your side so long as I live. Nova smiled, combing Pandora's hair repeatedly. She did so until her mistress completely relaxed and dipped into a period of meditation. Once the man around her began to flicker, she pulled away, leaving Pandora be. Exos wandered off around the train, seemingly enraptured by its architecture. As for Dirk, he found himself drifting toward the bar. It was there that he got curious, seeing many types of alcohol, most of which were enhanced with both mana and anima. The bartender smiled at him from behind the counter. What will it be, good sir? I'm curious, so give me something interesting. Very well. This one is called the Salamander's Tongue. Appetizing name. Dirk laughed while sitting, and the bartender started preparing a fancy drink with all kinds of coordinated movements. He even cast magic, integrating it into the drink. Then, the drink was finished. A small glass of a fire red liquid swirled before Dirk. Occasionally, tongues of fire flickered above the cup, generated from the fire mana within the drink. Dirk looked at the glass before him. Although he had laughed earlier, his face turned a bit somber, the amusement fading from his visage. He stared at the glass for a while, the bartender waiting behind the counter, unsure of what to do. Was Dirk unsatisfied? There wasn't anything wrong with the drink itself. But Dirk had asked for this, so he just waited, deciding that this was simply a peculiar customer. Eventually, Dirk seemed to force himself past something. Swiping the glass, he tipped it into his mouth, the red liquid flowing down his throat. Moments later, Dirk felt his body heat up. He couldn't help the belch that arose, and with it came a breath of fire, the heat within him flowing out with the flame. Whoosh! The bartender dodged the fire with a chuckle. Seems like you're compatible with this drink. How about the tainted diamond, if that's alright with you? Yeah, it's fine. Throwing around a couple more bottles, the bartender introduced another drink that looked like liquid glass with hints of a blue fog within. Dirk nodded to the man and drank it as well. It felt like he was gulping down something similar to a slime, only a bit duller and more viscous in nature. And the taste hit him with a wave of sour sweetness. The sour made him want to spit it out, but the sweetness made him enjoy it, striking an odd balance between the two that made him smile oddly. After finishing the glass, he nodded pleasantly. That was cool. I'm honored. But you seemed apprehensive about drinking. Is there something wrong? Perhaps you'd like to know more about them. I would, but that's not the issue. I guess I've got a little bit of, a fear, you could say. Of drinking? Something like that. It's stupid, but I thought maybe alcohol might teach me to push past it. Dirk spoke as another drink was placed in front of him. He observed the colorful liquid before downing it as well. The bartender spoke while mixing more drinks, all of different colors and containing various balances of elements. You shouldn't say it's a stupid fear. Surely a man such as yourself doesn't fear anything that doesn't deserve to be feared. 
and regardless of its nature, you're here now, making an effort to push past it. That takes great courage. Even if it's out of potential necessity? I believe the reasons for bravery are irrelevant. Does a soldier who is ordered to battle become any less brave simply because it was his order? Surely he pushed past the fear all the same. Unless he faced one fear to avoid the consequences of another, such as the ire of his commanding officer. Are you being ordered to drink alcohol? No. Then I assume you're not running from a greater consequence, and thus, you are brave for doing as you are. Hmm. Dirk hummed, taking a sip from a taller glass of what seemed like champagne. In truth, upon seeing this bar he got the idea that he could use it to attempt to surpass his fear of potions. Ever since Azura's mountain, Dirk abhorred potions of any kind. The mere sight of them made his stomach churn. But he hated the fact that this trauma was instilled so deeply, so he wanted to overcome it. Alcohol resembled those potions, although not completely, making it a good candidate for somehow easing his way back into using them. Because if there came a time where his life, or the lives of others, hinged on him using a potion, then he needed to be able to push past that fear. His healing skill was useful and fast, but it couldn't replenish his energy in the middle of a battle. Potions were also known to modify the body in some ways, like how Dirk's blood had been genetically altered and enhanced by Geralt at the academy after having one forced down his throat. Potions and the alchemy that produced them were marvelous things. They could become invaluable tools not unlike his nanites that could repair or boost his body on the fly, but Dirk needed to be able to use them. He also felt bad that he rejected Pandora's help back then. Dirk sat there, occasionally receiving a new and exotic drink from the bartender. After some time he stopped downing every glass and just stuck to tasting them. However, he felt queasy every time he lifted a glass to his mouth. The very thought of drinking something that could affect him in any way made him sick. But he forced past all those mental blocks, forcefully conditioning himself. Hey! Dirk called after he finished another glass. He felt no less sick, only more so as he drank more. But he had no intentions of stopping. I want to take all the drinks you have here. I also want you to teach me to mix drinks. We have about half a day to do so. I'll pay you if necessary. Hmm, well, I can't very well turn down someone in need. Here, come behind the bar. Mixing drinks is not unlike alchemy just without all the complicated magic. How good are you at memorizing things? Don't worry about that. Just tell me everything you know. Dirk pulled himself into the bar. After that, the bartender started spilling all his knowledge about mixing drinks. All the types of alcohol, all the different mixers, myriads of fruits that you could add to spike the tastes, plus all the different ways to mix these vast combinations of liquids. It was years' worth of information being spilled across the span of about ten hours. Never once did he stop talking, and never once did Dirk interrupt him. He, or more specifically Spite, simply focused on absorbing the information. And the concepts were simple enough. The bartender managed to teach Dirk a drink utilizing every bottle of alcohol there was behind that bar. He even pulled several more from a back room. So by the end, Dirk had a slew of knowledge available to him, stored and catalogued by Spite for later use. Not only that, but he stashed every single bottle of liquid, fruit, and all kinds of tools into his pocket ring. By the way, if you ever stop by the Elven Paradise, be sure to ask about their alcohol. I hear it's the best in all the lands. I'll remember that. Taking the last piece of advice, Dirk stumbled out from behind the bar. All the drinks he had tasted, which was all of them, had started to affect him. And he let it instead of isolating it with his nanites, because doing so would ruin the point of conditioning himself to ingesting something that affected him. He took a seat on a couch, leaving behind the now empty bar along with a sack containing a generous amount of coin for the bartender. Not long after, Pandora exited her room, finding a slightly drunk Dirk and Exos nowhere to be found. Her brow raised amusedly, seeing a bottle in his hand. What's this? Found yourself a new hobby? I don't enjoy this one. I'm tired. Well, we're about to arrive. And I hope you can drive drunk, because I'm not. 
have exos do it. He doesn't know how. As if that smartass couldn't easily build his own car. Dirk muttered with drowsy movements. From behind Pandora, Nova looked at Dirk with confusion. Sensing her gaze, Dirk's head picked back up, his aura sharpening as he looked at the maid. He pointed the bottle at her. I can still kill you. I am sorry. My, you really are drunk. Pandora chuckled at the exchange, walking over and grabbing the bottle from Dirk's hands. She tasted it and nodded. Good stuff. I guess you do need to learn to operate even while impaired. I already do. You do? They drug you during the program to teach you how to work around it. Must be something they introduced after my class. Well, at least that means you can still drive. Dirk went silent, frowning, causing Pandora to smile. Then, a horn blared, and the train came to a halt. Exos appeared at around that time. Time to go. Pandora led the way, everyone leaving the train station, Dirk walking smoothly behind. At first glance it didn't seem like he was impaired in the slightest. From Nova's perspective, his movements weren't as sharp. But she knew better than to test his ability to fight even in that state. Like that, they made their way to the edge of the city. And from there, they drove toward Horizon Territory. Chapter 154, Nostalgia No no, shake it a bit more, and then dump it with the fruit juice. But I already added the juice. I told you not to, but it doesn't matter much. Just shake. Fine. Slip. Shit. Dirk cursed as liquid spilled all over the passenger seat one of the cups flying out of his grasp. Spite looked down from on top of Dirk's head. You're trying to be fancy. You're not that bartender. I thought the technique was there for a reason. Mixing is mixing. I could get a blender and mix it just as easily. Kind of. Just shake it normally next time. I smell alcohol. Suddenly, Pandora's voice echoed inside the car. She opened her eyes exiting her meditation. When she looked up, she saw Dirk mixing drinks over the passenger seat of the car. It so happened that neither of his hands were on the steering wheel, yet they were still driving. She peeked over only to see his niece steering the vehicle, causing her to roll her eyes. I swear, it's been all of six days and you've become a proper alcoholic. You've put more effort into studying drinks than your magic. I still get sick when I drink, so more conditioning is needed. It's alcohol. You're gonna feel a bit sick when you drink it. Especially for someone like you who has no experience with it. You probably get drunk way too easily. Not really. Dirk refuted while cleaning things up. According to what he's experienced, it actually took a shocking amount of magic alcohol to even get him buzzed. He could down two entire bottles worth of liquor spiked with anima and barely start feeling warm. At first he thought it was just his metabolism, or maybe his high rank. But after Spite took a look, he found that his blood simply rejected almost all of the negative effects of the alcohol. The only reason he could feel anything at all was because all the alcohol he took from that bar was some of the highest class drinks that were enhanced with both anima and mana designed to get powerful people drunk. Sure, it wasn't the most powerful alcohol there was. But it was well above what Dirk should be able to handle, and yet he did so easily. Which was good, because that meant he could focus more on conditioning himself rather than worrying about getting drunk. And even after almost a week, he still felt sick whenever he drank. It was like anything other than water was a poison that his body wanted to throw back up. And in fact, after pushing himself enough, he did throw up. Pandora was always too focused on her magic though to notice, as was Exos with his enchanting. She sighed. Just don't ruin my car, please. And don't push yourself so hard. There are some things that time can heal as well. You don't always have to put yourself through your traumas to conquer them. That's counterintuitive. From your perspective, maybe. Pandora gave a soft smile as Dirk refuted again. Then, she closed her eyes. I'll focus until we arrive. Just let me know when we get there. Sure. Dirk nodded, focusing back on his drinks. And not long later, 
he spotted a massive city in the distance. Taking out an orb, he tapped it a few times before sending a message. Dirk! Hi mom! Dirk smiled as he stepped down from the vehicle. Cecilia dove in, hugging her son a little too tight for his comfort. I missed you so much. You're okay, right? I heard from Ethan about the things that happened in that city. You did an amazing thing. Yeah. Dirk grit his teeth for nearly half a minute while his mother squeezed him with atrocious strength. And when she separated, he took a deep breath, causing her to laugh. Sorry, my baby. I'm glad you're here. And I see the princess is here as well. Looking over his shoulder, Cecilia spotted Pandora stepping down from the truck. Pandora curtsied a bit in greeting. Nice to see you again, Madam Strider. H.M. I'm just glad you didn't get my child into trouble. Ha ha, surely you don't believe our trip was so uneventful. Pandora smirked a bit. How ludicrous was it to think that they hadn't gotten into trouble? Surely Cecilia wasn't so naive. But the protective mother just narrowed her eyes. I mean trouble he couldn't fight his own way out of. Well, I don't know if there's any such thing. Don't worry, Madam Strider. Your son happens to be irreplaceable to me. Pandora spoke while linking with Dirk's arm, almost as if in provocation. It caused Cecilia to narrow her eyes a bit further before glancing at Dirk, who looked as still and calm as a statue. Pandora also looked at him, poking him in the side. Is acting as neutral as possible a defense mechanism or something? More so inconspicuous. It's not working. Shut up. He turned his head away, earning a chuckle from Pandora. Cecilia watched, more so curious than anything. She wasn't exactly fond of this diabolical princess, but it seemed that the relationship between the two was closer than it had been before. Even she remembered the distance between them that now looked largely gone. Still, it was difficult for Cecilia to not be protective. If there was any child to trust, it was Dirk, but when it came to him she was also extra cautious. But she knew when to back off a bit, so with a small sigh, she shifted the topic to the others who had somehow tagged along with the duo. Exos and Nova exited the truck, both of them observing Cecilia curiously. Nova was particularly observant, but when she suddenly felt her hair stand on end, she retreated and looked down at the floor. Cecilia smiled and walked over. And who are these two? And my name is Exos Havilite, madam. Exos stuttered a bit, catching himself as he stared at Cecilia in an amour. He was obviously embarrassed as he bowed a bit in greeting. Nova also curtsied, but she refused to meet Cecilia's gaze as she spoke. I am Nova, and I serve the princess. A pleasure, Nova. I hope you and my son can also get along. There aren't many he can relate to like you. Why yes. Nova found herself baffled. His mother? Were they a family of freaks? Why did both mother and son feel like they could wring her neck with nothing but their gaze? And why was she so easily being seen through? With a chuckle, Cecilia turned back to Dirk. So, my son. To what do I owe this unexpected visit? Just visiting before continuing. Thought I should say hello to everyone. I see. Now tell me, why does my sixteen-year-old son reek of alcohol? Dirk's face went neutral again, and perhaps in a moment of panic, found himself looking toward Pandora. Her brows raised. What are you looking at me for? You're the one who sunk into depravity. Shut up. I'm just experimenting, or something. He spoke, hoping that was a half-decent explanation. And Cecilia found herself curious. She knew her son wouldn't take to alcohol without purpose. In fact, he shouldn't like drinking anything remotely similar to alcohol. Ever since his time at Azure's Mountain, he hadn't put any liquid other than water into his stomach. Wait, maybe that's... Cecilia's eyes widened, coming to a conjecture. And she quickly decided she wouldn't question it. She stepped forward, combing Dirk's hair back before giving him a kiss on the forehead. All right, it's fine. Unfortunately, your father isn't here. He's on the front lines with your brother and sister. 
sister, Viola. She returned not long after the advent. Cecilia guided them through the city while speaking. Apparently, while Viola wasn't enlisted with the Empire's military, she was still acting as a mercenary. And since she was the daughter of a Grand Marshal and the sister of a Marshal, she had a rather lofty position, especially with her skills. However, the second sister, Rita, had yet to appear. After disappearing a few years ago, Rita hasn't shown up in the Empire once. Not even I know where she might be, though I suspect she's in the other world. Elven territories? Why? Because her elven lineage started to awaken. It had started when she was going on adventures throughout the Dark Kingdom, which was about the time when I last saw her. If she's smart, then she should be trying to get blessed by the World Tree. Oh. So how's her tear? She was really strong when I last saw her. Dirk asked curiously. When he last saw her at the academy, she had been a tier 5 who was already learning void walking. She even had a domain. With a perfect darkness attribute, she should be far stronger. But Cecilia spoke otherwise. Your sister stagnated, actually. It's something most dark magicians and all elves go through. You see, elves go through magical growth spurts early in their lives. But then their progress slows dramatically. They could jump three tiers in one year, and then not advance another tier for a decade. That's because of their blessing, which is also technically a curse. And dark elven magicians have it even harder because at some point, they must decide on their relationship with darkness, which can halt their progress depending on how they decide. HM, then she must be either having the time of her life or going through hell right now. Pandora suddenly chimed in. Although she didn't know Dirk's sister, she definitely knew about all the species of this world. She probably wasn't any less informed than Cecilia. And her words were confirmed by a nod. Correct. Thankfully she had already formed her domain, so her difficulty should be lesser and her talent greater. Well, unless she deviated in some way. Cecilia muttered darkly, causing Dirk to show a bit of concern. He actually knew what she meant by that. Deviation was a big concept for dark magicians, and it was determined by their path in the dark arts. Giving into the darkness too much could cause one to gradually lose their sense of ego in the pursuit of power, making them crazy. It was why, despite being generally accepted by society, dark magicians were still stigmatized. Dirk took the extreme path of absolutely dominating his element, not giving even an inch of space to its chaos. But that wasn't an option for most, and they were required to change themselves and their psyche in order to accommodate the element in its comprehensions. A balance needed to be struck, and one state of mind heavily influenced their path in the dark arts. But Dirk wasn't sure why Rita, his buttery sister, would have even the slightest chance of deviating. Especially because she was so talented. Why would she deviate? Did something happen? He asked with a surprising amount of urgency, taking Pandora off guard. There were few people Dirk would concern himself over. It seemed he was close with his sister. Cecilia couldn't help a wry smile. Well, you're actually the reason. Rita disappeared not long after hearing of your kidnapping. I guess she knew she couldn't help you as she was, so she left to go hone herself. She said she had gone to the Dark Kingdom to study magic there, but during the advent I couldn't find her. That means she probably wasn't in the kingdom anymore, thus my guess is about her going to the World Tree. Oh. Dirk scratched his head. It seemed he would need to apologize when he saw her again. If he could find her in the first place. Well, it was at least good that they were going in her assumed direction. Perhaps by some miracle they would find her. For a moment, Dirk found himself longing to see his sister. But he quickly pushed the thought back. Brooding over it wouldn't get him anywhere. Cecilia changed the topic with a smile. Don't worry about it much. Now let's go home. I'm sure you all are tired from travel. Yes, please. I'd love to see Dirk's old room. Pandora smiled, and they continued toward the house. When they arrived, Pandora took in the sights of the house with great pleasure. Dirk was also quite nostalgic. 
he had come home briefly after escaping the mountain before going right back out to the Dark Kingdom. It had felt like years since then. But beyond that, he found it funny. Pandora was oddly interested in the house, and she wasted no time in checking out his room. He laughed when she was disappointed. With words like, I don't know what I expected and how dull, she went around critiquing the place. And it was true. Dirk was never one for decor. It was like all that style was taken and put into his combat instead. Like that, night fell. They had rolled into the city around sunset anyway, and they really were tired from the long drives. So they retired early. Exos and Nova were offered guest rooms, as was Pandora. Yet, she found herself in Dirk's room anyway. However, Dirk didn't retire when they did. Instead, he made his way to the study, a large bottle of another concoction he brewed up during the drive. His father's study was a place Dirk frequented when he was a young child. He still had those vivid memories of gathering intel with his stubby little four-year-old hands, taking several seconds just to separate and flip a single page, and even more time to figure out how to knock the books down in the first place. The bookshelves were dustier than they had been though. It seemed that they hadn't been used in quite some time. Well, they were all growing up. Despite his father being in his nineties and his mother approaching her seventies, it seemed they were still maturing. After all, raising your children was just as much of a growing experience as becoming an adult was. And many things had happened, especially in the past few years. Their family had been through quite a bit. One child became a soldier, one got kidnapped, two daughters disappeared while adventuring, and only one had yet come back. And now a war had thrown them into conflict. Dirk was about to continue traveling the world and two were fighting a war against monsters alongside their father. As for the mother, who knew what she did in her free time? Going through the study, Dirk concluded that nobody had time for leisurely reading anymore. In fact, the maids who had once frequented this palace when they were kids were nowhere to be found. Dirk only saw the head maid and an assistant, both of which were merely maintaining the place and standing by should the masters suddenly come home. It made Dirk melancholic. A part of him longed for those days when things were simpler. When he could just go to school, be loved by his parents, and play around with Ava. Are you alright? Dirk suddenly heard a voice, seeing it was his mother. He lowered the bottle he was about to take a swig out of, sighing. Yeah. It's just been a long time. I would normally say that you're exaggerating and have yet to experience even a fraction of what life has to offer, but I don't think that applies to you. Sometimes I forget, but you're not just a 16-year-old teen. I find myself deeply curious about what your other world was like. And even then, you've experienced so much here. Cecilia took a seat at the one desk in the study, turning the chair to Dirk as he leaned on a bookcase. And her words caused him to dive into yet another bout of nostalgia. He recalled his old memories as if they had happened a hundred years ago. Some of those memories felt completely foreign to him. He mumbled. Maybe one day I can let you see what it's like. There's in fact a light and dark spell that lets you display images of what's in your memories. It requires a fairly strong mind, but it's nothing that advanced. I haven't learned it myself, but it should be possible for you to learn it sometime in the future. Well, there's that, and the alternative. Just remember that I came here from a world without magic, and yet it was by no fluke. Perhaps in the future, they might develop whatever technology they had back then. And when that happens, the people of my old world will come marching over with weapons that this world can't begin to understand. Dirk spoke those words with great foreboding, causing Cecilia's blood to run cold. This was the first she was hearing of this, but she could understand that a world which could bridge the gap between two planets was not one to be trifled with. They would come with weapons that could destroy them, at the least. In fact, it seemed almost inevitable by how Dirk spoke of it. Suddenly, she thought that she would need to ask Pandora to find the magic she spoke of. She was now morbidly curious about their native world, and surely Pandora should be able to cast the magic. Even if not right now, she could do so in the near future. Then again, whether she would agree was a different story. Chapter 155, Vulnerable 
Dirk and his mother were silent as both had their own complex thoughts. He thought back to his youth. There had been a lapse in consciousness after Dirk went through the portal. Still, he and Pandora assumed that they hadn't been reborn much longer after they died. After all, Earth had yet to develop their dimensional technology again and come through. So his younger days were filled with thoughts of how he would live his new life according to what he hated about his old life. He surely didn't think that anything like getting kidnapped by Azura would happen, so his mind was filled with notions of a simpler life filled with far less conflict than his past. It was why he was so devastated when those hopes had been shattered. Part of Dirk didn't want to fight. Well, that was probably a part of everyone. Either way, he wouldn't mind not aggravating the high powers of this world and attracting unfathomably deadly individuals and scenarios toward him. But he had decided back then within that mountain that he wouldn't settle for anything less than the topmost echelon of power. He would become a god amongst men just like the kings and emperors of this world, or die trying. This resolution was also why he had a hard time accepting what Azura did to him. He didn't want to have to travel down that path, but he was forced. Only Absolution was able to get Dirk out of that living hell. Half-assed goals would only result in his demise. And not long after that, he was roped into global catastrophe alongside Pandora. So it seemed everything was going according to plan. But within his father's study, surrounded by dusty books and memories of a childhood much brighter than his old one, he found himself just slightly regretful. He longed for a life he would never have, and yet accepted the fact that he would never have it. The feeling of having to do such a thing wasn't much different from feeling sick after taking a few sips of alcohol. I'm tired. Dirk thought that while letting out a slow breath. But he still brought up one more topic. By the way. His voice caused Cecilia to snap out of her own ponder. We plan on requisitioning an airship. It was the main reason we came back here. We need a mode of transport faster than a car. Oh? That's rather bold. Not to say that you shouldn't give it a try. Cecilia smiled a bit, crossing her legs in thought. After the war started, the Emperor suddenly introduced dozens of airships and created an aerial armada. They've been instrumental in moving massive amounts of people and cargo where our teleporters can't reach. Anyway, you aren't getting your hands on any of the standard airships since those are all either being used or are stationed in a fort for maintenance. But I can point you to a production facility. I would say that's easier to steal from than a fort, especially since nobody knows about it. Well, it would help us a lot. Sure. But I won't help you directly. Take it as a challenge. I want to see you take one by yourselves. She smiled brightly as if she wasn't technically committing treason by doing what she was. And Dirk smiled with her, his spirits brightening a bit. All right then. I'm going to bed. Sure. Sleep as much as you want. Tomorrow we can visit the others on the front lines. Last I heard, Alec is out there as well. Oh. That'll be fun. Dirk thought about his one friend while leaving the study. Cecilia watched him leave with heavy eyes. Walking down the hallway, Dirk made it to his room. He opened the door and entered. After closing the door behind him, Pandora swooped in from the side. Dressed in a thin nightgown, she hugged him from behind. I felt you. What is you down, my dear? She spoke of their connection in a soft voice. Within it, Dirk could feel great allure, not to mention what he felt on his back. His body momentarily got a wave of goosebumps, but when that went away, he responded in a monotone voice. Nothing. Just some optimistic thoughts of mine. Optimism only gets you down when you think you can't have it. And I, for one, don't believe there's anything you can't get should you want it enough. This world doesn't allow that sort of hope. And who did you let put that idea into your head? Dirk went silent. His hopes had very effectively been crushed and ground into dust before being chewed and shit out by the monster known as Azura. The very concept of powerlessness was almost literally engraved into his bones, powerlessness before those who stood at the top of the world. Either way, Dirk believed the simple life he desired to be impossible. This world, its magic, its people, wouldn't allow it. 
his life would be a never-ending battle to rise to the top, and even then, there were gods who would deny his rest waiting at the top of that mountain. In that picture, where did his ideal life fit in? Pandora spoke into his ear, as if answering that question. Dirk, understand that hope is the antithesis to everything that fights against you. Azura tried to crush your hope and your will to continue on. He made you believe that there was nothing for you except the endless abyss of warfare and death. And I know that this war did nothing to help that either. Everything seems to be denying you hope for something better than what you have. Pandora slipped around to his front, her words echoing in Dirk's mind. They were infectious, stressing the weight on his heart. And he looked into her ruby-red eyes that seemed to draw him in deeper. For a moment he thought that she was affecting his mind with her powers of temptation, but he felt none of that at play, causing something in him to stir even more than before. Her hands cupped his face, rising before slipping his blindfold off and revealing his cursed eyes. A finger traced the surface of that cracked skin. Don't give them that power over you. You're allowed to hope for something better, and nobody can stop you from fighting for it. For peace, for security, for happiness and love. All those things are just waiting for you to grab them. Begging you to take them. Her arms slipped around his neck as she whispered. And then, she planted her lips on his. Unlike before though, it wasn't soft. It was full, Dirk unable to resist as she sucked him in. Nor did he. The euphoric wave of pleasure caught him off guard. He had never felt anything like it before. It was even more intoxicating than alcohol. He felt like he never wanted to stop. And after several seconds, they separated. Pandora's bated breath brushed across his face. So take me. She spoke, and with a jump, wrapped her legs around his waist. Dirk caught her, the two moving toward the bed. And they fell across it while climbing on top of each other. Pandora glued herself to his body while voraciously swapping tongue. And they continued like that for several minutes, neither even having the thought of stopping cross their mind. They just let the pleasure of each other's desires flood their minds. But not even that could completely cloud Dirk's thoughts. Even through the pleasure, he couldn't help but feel a bit guilty. He knew who was in his mind, and he didn't have any thoughts of pushing her out. But he found himself conflicted in this moment, because he couldn't deny what he was feeling right now. Pandora had been his sworn enemy up until a month or so ago. Gradually she grew on him, and as she kept fighting, so his defenses fell. And tonight, in a moment of vulnerability, she seemed to check all the right boxes and strike right at his heart, carving out a place within it for herself. And he couldn't find it within him to deny it. The only reason he would deny her was due to who she used to be, but he had reconciled that. Seeing her collapse over her failure was a major turning point for his relationship with her. It made him realize that, like him, she was a bit broken too. And he felt that he was the only one who could help put her back together. To deny her, and how he was beginning to feel about her, would contradict all that. So he couldn't. But now, in the heat of the moment, he remembered another girl he had given a bit of his heart to. And once remembered, he couldn't forget. Still, it was only a faint portion of his mind that remembered. The rest was focused elsewhere. But the overwhelming emotions seemed to drain him as well, because at some point, he slowed down and drifted with the pleasure into the silence of the night. So his consciousness faded, yet ever filled with those insuppressible feelings of satisfaction. Mmm. -hmm. There was a small moan as Dirk woke, the brightness of the sun piercing through the curtains of his window. He stretched as he did so, feeling wholly rested and rejuvenated. He even smiled a bit, feeling good. But as he shifted, he could feel something pinning down his arm. It made him freeze as his mana vision focused. He found Pandora beside him. He was practically wearing her as she clutched his body. And the thin nightgown she wore had slipped sometime during the night. The sight of that exposed pink nipple almost made his mind blank. In fact, Pandora's entire image was almost sucking him in, spurring on the instincts of his body with full force. It took his inhuman willpower to pull away. She probably wouldn't mind being woken up and ravaged, but he did. He wasn't exactly ready to take that step. 
he was realizing just what those things were beginning to entail, and doing something like that would take far more consideration. What it meant for him to form that kind of bond was taking shape, and its potential impact on his path in this life would be significant. Suddenly, Dirk found himself questioning this whole situation. How the hell did I get sucked in like that? It's like the past me is nowhere to be found. He sighed inwardly, and very gently, slipped out from underneath Pandora. Of course, she slept like a corpse anyway, so she didn't wake. After that, he dressed before heading downstairs. It was odd how he reverted back to old habits, taking familiar steps through a hallway before happening upon the dining room. It was there that he found his mother and the head maid. Breakfast was being served. Of course, Dirk couldn't care too much about the breakfast. Instead, he saw the small smile his mother gave him, his ears burning in shame. That was the first time. So that isn't what your entire trip has been like? Don't get me wrong, I'm not one to interfere in my children's love lives. But I can't help but be surprised. You seemed to hate her not long ago. Dirk refused to explain himself. It was oddly difficult to say that his mind had changed, especially when he was rather stubborn about things. Even he was surprised with himself, let alone his mother. Seeing that, Cecilia chuckled a bit and waved. Don't worry about it. I trust in your judgment. Come sit and eat. Fine. Dirk sighed, washing his thoughts of embarrassment and taking a seat. Right now, he was rather glad he didn't have eyes. Surely they would give away even more of his thoughts. He was served breakfast by the head maid as he sat, seeing a large platter. None of it was as luxurious as the stuff Pandora had prepared for their trips, but the homely feel it gave off was enough for him. He ate with pleasant thoughts, feeling like he was young again. He remembered when he would have to drag or carry Rita down in the mornings. She would always go to his room in the morning before falling back asleep in his bed. The piggybacks became a morning ritual. I want to see Rita. Dirk had those thoughts while finishing off his plate. After that, he sat in silence for a while. In that time, Cecilia spoke softly. Dirk. Hmm. I'm glad you found someone you can be vulnerable with. His mother's smile was loving as he focused on her. Dirk knew his mother probably didn't approve of Pandora all that much. Neither did he until recently. They both probably knew it was a miracle how he had let her get so close to him. But he did. It's different when you can be close with someone else, isn't it? Your father was someone I found that in. After everything I had been through with Azura, it took a lot for me to open up. But he was very persistent. He said all the right things and promised me everything that I ever wanted. He gave me love and a family. And I'm glad that you're finding those things for yourself. After all, there's only so much your mother can give you. At some point, my baby needs to leave the nest and find a chick of his own. She finished with a laugh, causing Dirk to smile. However, her next words made him sweat. Of course, you're also going to need to figure out what to do with your other girlfriend. I know you didn't forget about that childhood sweetheart of yours. Dirk didn't respond, his face going completely neutral as if he was just staring off into the distance. That only made her smile more though. And then, they heard footsteps. My Dirk has another girlfriend. This is the first time I'm hearing of this. Pandora turned the corner with a sweet smile, dressed in a casual t-shirt and sweats that had been designed after clothes from Earth. She looked no less beautiful but her smile made Dirk sink even farther into his own world of selective ignorance. We need to go see Dad and the others today. No no, I must hear about this rival of mine. Is she human? Elf? Hybrid? Dirk was silent, absolutely nothing changing on his face. But with her last guess, she smiled. She's a hybrid. I gave away nothing. No, but your mother did. Pandora glanced at Cecilia, who was a bit caught off guard. Then she moved over behind Dirk's seat, wrapping her arms around him and whispering in his ear. Surely I'll need to meet this girl sometime, no? Nobody leaves that stone-cold heart of yours so easily, so I'll need to properly vet her. 
After all, unless she's extraordinary, she won't be able to survive being in a relationship with you. Unless she proves herself, then she's automatically disqualified to compete with me. It's not a contest. Oh, I know. But just remember, you're not the only one who gets to pick. If I want you, then surely I'm going to fight until you're mine, regardless of your own feelings on the matter. Pandora's smile was slightly maddened as she spoke into his ear, and from across the table, Cecilia had a wry smile. It seemed Dirk had his work cut out for him. This princess wasn't so easily handled. Not that she could judge much. She too had a face like that with her own husband. An assassin like her got what she wanted, and there was very little to stop her when she had her mind set on something. But then, she waved. All right. Keep the romance to a minimum in front of me, please. It's hard to watch. Very well. You hear that, Dirk? You can't be all over me anymore. Try to hold it in, okay? Dirk was silent, baffled by her audacity to say such a thing. Then, she suddenly leaned toward his neck. Let me get a sip too. Right after she muttered, her teeth were exposed, two fangs quickly poking into his neck. Cecilia was momentarily surprised before she rolled her eyes. Did I not just say? Never mind. Just finish up whatever it is you two do and get dressed. We're heading to the front lines in an hour. All right. With Dirk's mumble, she left the two lovebirds and retreated to her room. Chapter 156 Front Lines the front lines that Cecilia spoke of were not unlike what the dwarves had set up against the monster hordes that spewed from the dragon lair of Earth. In fact, it was almost exactly the same. Except, instead of just defending against monsters, the Horizon Empire had to fight against the living wasteland. After all, fire was always more destructive than the other elements. To get to the front lines, the only thing they needed to do was take a teleporter that hundreds of people went through every hour. The teleporter nexus that Horizon had set up was beside their commercial teleporter nexus, which baffled Pandora even more than she thought she could be. This technology that her dark kingdom had barely begun to develop being deployed on such a large scale made her think that her railways were primitive trash. Well, she couldn't complain for very long, because perhaps these teleporters were the only thing saving the Horizon Empire from utter annihilation. They felt it as soon as they arrived at their destination. The wave of heat that graced their faces and threatened to singe the ends of their hair. It was lucky that Dirk had a perfect affinity for fire and Pandora had a perfect affinity for water and ice. But for the others, they weren't so lucky. Exos frown and Nova, while expressionless, looked uncomfortable as she started to sweat a bit. From their teleporter, they could see dozens of troops moving every which way. Some were running by themselves, off to complete whatever task they were given but most were in formations, marching or jogging in and out of the teleporter platforms. Dirk could sense all the copious amounts of spatial waves generated by the teleporters. How they weren't constantly destabilizing each other, he wasn't sure. That was, until he sensed a single but massive power source sending out occasional pulses of dark mana. It seemed to be a stabilizer. The pulses of dark mana it sent out made space solidify. When Dirk tried to poke through his surroundings as if he were void walking, he found it far more difficult, at least until the pulse faded. It fascinated him for a short moment before the group exited the Nexus. And then, their sights were blessed with what could very well be a hell on Earth. Move! Team 3, man those sentries. Get this man to medical. Next wave is in 25 minutes. Screams rang out as Dirk walked out into what seemed like a huge base. The skies above were red and black, almost as if the very atmosphere were burning. Dark clouds roiled and occasionally crackled with lightning that sent low tremors through the air, making everyone feel like some god was letting out growls of hatred. The air was uncomfortable to breathe, filled with fire mana that normal mages would find suffocating. Even fire mages would find the excessive fuel around them too much to handle. Behind Dirk, there were buildings that towered dozens and hundreds of meters into the sky. Many were interconnected between their bodies, bridges allowing easy movement between establishments. To the sides were massive fortifications. 
there were towers that contained magical turrets armed with complex enchantments along with places for mages to launch spells from, similar to pillboxes. And in front was the edge of the massive wall they stood atop. Dirk moved forward, weaving through a dozen people before leaning over the edge. And truly, the atmosphere properly reflected the hellish landscape. Beyond the three extra layers of walls around the fort was a wasteland of flowing lava, ash, obsidian, and carnage. Dirk could see a few rivers that occasionally burst with bubbles of molten rock and metal. These lava rivers flowed off into the distance, alongside the advancing armies of monsters. And its source was an utterly massive volcano. Dirk almost believed that his mana sight was being distorted when he saw it. He had to lift his head. The top of the volcano wasn't simply on the horizon. Instead, it seemed like it existed in the sky, even above the clouds. It was a colossal mountain that he could barely fathom traversing. It was this volcano that was wreaking utter devastation, spewing out enough heat, ash, and lava to turn what was likely a normal mountain range into a harrowing exclusion zone. And from the base of this volcano flooded thousands of monsters. In this respect, it was similar to the dwarven rusted bastion that defended against the monsters of the lair. But in every other respect, including difficulty, this place was far more treacherous. How a base managed to be built here, Dirk didn't know. Perhaps the emperor had to personally step in, otherwise there was no way they could have established a stronghold so quickly. It had still only been a few months since the war started. Wow! Isn't this something? Pandora nodded impressively, which was a massive compliment coming from her. Cecilia sighed in response. Yes, it's impressive, but this place is even worse than a war zone. Then again, it's the only reason Ethan was able to get as good as he is now. Many fire mages have made serious advancements in this place. In that respect, this would be a good time for you to practice Dirk. That is, if you guys aren't leaving immediately. We have some time. Accumulating power is just as important as the adventure. Pandora smiled while answering, and Dirk was pleased by her words. They came here to steal an airship for transportation, but Dirk didn't want to leave so soon. He wanted to grow his magical power, something he was lacking in, as well as spend time with his family. His family, primarily his parents, were powerful people willing to teach him everything they knew. Training with his mother for a total time of a mere couple of months pushed him to become a rook-class warrior capable of utilizing his aura alongside weapons. Besides, the threats they were soon to face wouldn't be as friendly as before. Pandora had no connection with the elves that would give her any status to take advantage of. They would have to enter their territory and bring chaos to the world tree before stealing an unknown but incalculably valuable artifact. And after their first failure, both Dirk and Pandora realized that their power wasn't satisfactory. Pandora took an especially hard hit, so she surely didn't want to depart before preparing. All right, let's go see your father. Maybe your sister will be there too. Cecilia waved everyone along, and the group pulled their eyes away from the fiery wasteland before heading to the largest building in the base. This place wasn't as busy, but there were still plenty of officers moving about. The foot traffic only grew as the next wave approached. Dirk! Suddenly though, there was a shout. Nobody really cared and the surroundings continued on. Dirk stopped though, looking over to see his father. But the voice hadn't come from his father. Instead, to his right stood Ethan. And to his left stood Viola, Dirk's eldest sibling and sister. He recognized her quickly, but he still barely believed it was her. As a child, Viola had dirty blonde hair as well as slightly pointed ears, symbols of her elven traits inherited from their father. But now, her hair had turned platinum, almost snow white. Her ears were just a bit longer, but not as much as a true elf. And her most glaring change was how tall she was. She was as tall as Dirk was, both standing at over six feet tall. It wasn't as tall as Ethan, but still rather towering and she was lithe, just like her mother. Even Dirk recognized her beauty, though that made him wonder what Rita looked like, a girl who had been the most beautiful of all the siblings. After shouting in shock, Viola moved with blinding speed. Before she even arrived before him, 
Dirk could feel the air between them shift for her body, entirely eliminating wind resistance. The ground also roiled along with the soles of her feet, allowing her to expertly throw her body forward. And she appeared before him with a bright smile, wrapping him up in an emotional hug. She was silent as Dirk caught himself, slowly returning the hug. Of everyone, Dirk had probably been the most detached from Viola. She was always too far ahead in life to really connect with him like Rita had, so their lives hardly crossed paths. But he could sense the relief and happiness in her hug. It really showed him that their familial bonds superseded whatever friendship they may or may not have cultivated. I missed you, kid. It's really good to see you. You too. Dirk smiled. It had been many, many years since they'd even seen each other. She had disappeared even before Dirk entered the academy, not to mention the years at Azura's Mountain. But it was like none of that mattered. The two separated, Viola smiling and ruffling Dirk's hair. Look at you. All grown up now, huh? I can tell you're aging better than your brute brother back there. I can hear you. Ethan walked over with a frown poking through his beard, making Viola chuckle mischievously. Dirk smiled a bit more. Those two always had that kind of sibling rivalry. It was good that nothing had changed. Though, unlike before, Viola wasn't simply able to beat down her rambunctious younger brother using her extra couple years to her advantage. No, her power ran far deeper now. Dirk could recognize it at a glance. Viola was born with air and earth attributes. They weren't perfect, but they were still fantastic. Not only that, but she was able to wield anima and refine her body. At the academy, she worked toward becoming a strength and speed-based warrior. Using the wind and the earth as the basis for her movement and her body refinement for strength, she could become a well-rounded combatant with few weaknesses. It seemed she had attempted to take these things to the extreme, at least for her speed. Dirk didn't sense atrocious strength like Ethan. Instead, she was nimble, quick. And based on Dirk's estimations, she was a tier 5 and rank 6, a level ahead of himself in both respects and about the same as Ethan. It seemed like both of them would reach their father's level, but Dirk knew it wouldn't be so easy despite them advancing so fast at a young age. Dirk saw Viola's platinum hair flip as she turned toward Riker. He nodded at Dirk. It's good to see you, son. How are your travels? Well, I'm here, so it wasn't too bad. I'm not sure if that's comforting to hear as your father, but I would agree. Still, adventure should involve more than just keeping yourself alive. Yeah. Dirk smirked a bit. Angering an entire empire wasn't exactly conducive to a healthy life, but they managed. At the very least, Dirk got to see some new places and meet new people, so it wasn't all bad. Then, Dirk's family all turned toward Pandora. Dressed in her casual earthly clothes, she sensed their gazes and curtsied a bit, her purple hair spilling over her shoulders. Nice to meet you all, especially Dirk's sister. I am Pandora Venatis. So you're her? Viola narrowed her eyes a bit, seemingly already heard much about the vampire princess, which wasn't surprising considering Ethan no doubt spoke of it after his meeting with Dirk at the ruined city. Sensing Viola's caution, Pandora smiled a bit deeper. Yes, I'm the vampire princess, though I'd prefer to keep my identity a bit more discreet while I'm here. I wouldn't want the emperor coming to see me right now as that might delay our plans for the future. Why would that happen though? Did you do something that would warrant the emperor's interference? Forgive me, but that information is a bit above your pay grade. H.M. Viola frowned, to which Pandora's smile turned to a slightly snarky grin. But then, her body jerked as Dirk pinched her side. Ow. Why? You're being rude. I thought I was being pretty nice. Drop the condescension then. And stop provoking obvious responses. For someone who likes to keep secrets, you talk a lot. It's called mind games and deception. And I'm telling you to stop doing that with my family. It's unnecessary. Dirk and Pandora bantered while everyone around them watched. They just let it play out, gradually smiling as if watching a play. Then, Viola grabbed Dirk's arm, 
pulling him out of the conversation. All right. You're coming with me. Where? To the arena. And nobody is allowed to come. Since when do you get to decide that? Cecilia suddenly warped in front of her daughter, stopping her from dragging Dirk off. Seeing that, Viola smiled sheepishly. I was just gonna spar, Mom. Do I really need your permission for that? Fine. But we're watching, since I also want to see Dirk's progress. I'm coming too. Well since we're all going. Viola rolled her eyes, seeing as the entire group was going to follow. Like that, they all walked off to a rear district of the base. In these areas, there were many residential buildings like bunks and the like. There were few commercial and civilian areas primarily because those who could stand to live here needed to be powerful in the first place. Normal people couldn't bear the constant heat. Bypassing even those though, they made their way to what looked like training and drilling grounds. Here, they found fields of soldiers doing things like working out, practicing formations, sparring, and more. And there was one building with plenty of arenas. There, they picked out a private arena using Riker's authority and set themselves up. All right, pick out your best weapon. No armor. Yes armor. No, mom. Viola shouted back as Cecilia refuted from the stands, the two going back and forth before Viola could only give in. She sighed and turned back to Dirk. Equip your armor, then. As for the fight, I guess we go until one of us yields or there's an obvious winner. All right. Dirk nodded, taking his place at one end of the arena. It was a basic square platform, one reinforced with enchantments. In fact, it almost looked like rough malleable metal in Dirk's man of vision, making him think it had some self-repair properties. Thinking as he got ready, Dirk took out a short sword. However, this wasn't the ordinary metal short sword he had used before. Pandora's eyes widened as she saw the weapon. Bringing that out, huh? He must actually be serious about this. What is it? Cecilia asked from beside her, prompting Pandora to nod toward the blade. That's one of the artifacts straight out of our treasury, called the Sword of Dissonance. It's only a Tier 6 artifact, but its properties put it near Tier 7 in versatility. Basically, it's a sword you can't keep track of, one that can change its form at will while shifting through space in erratic patterns. Dirk's never used it, so either he wants to get used to it, or he's choosing a high-quality weapon so he can be serious with the battle. Either way, we're in for a show. Pandora smiled and sat back, her ruby-red eyes flashing. Cecilia turned back, looking at her two children. And just as she did, she was able to witness the appearance of Dirk's armor. Chapter 157 Inspiration Scales? Cecilia's eyes narrowed as her acute vision took in the details of Dirk's scale armor. It appeared over his body after he was covered by a black film, the scales poking out from within the black film and a helmet simply appearing on top of his head. The scales were small, but just big enough to be linked with rings. There were thousands of them, each one expertly placed and angled so that they all layered against each other without flaw and his helmet was entirely featureless, its sleek design making him look like some kind of futuristic knight. What was curious about it was how it had no openings to speak of for his face, merging smoothly into the scales that covered his neck and eliminating all potential weak points. It seemed rather inhuman to Viola. The scale armor made him look like some kind of black viper that moved without emotion, its only focus being the prey that would soon fall beneath its fangs. And then, she brought her own armor out. Unfortunately, it wasn't as impressive as Dirk's. It was a set of leather armor with certain areas of her body guarded by metal plating. Her chest, forearms, hips, shins, and other vital areas were all protected. But otherwise, the leather afforded her maximum range of motion. But did Dirk's not do the same? Unlike her armor, his had zero soft points that could be broken through. After all, at a certain level, the slightest weakness could turn into a devastating hindrance. One unguarded shoulder could result in a lost arm, a small slit for sight could become a mailbox for a well-placed arrow. Viola also didn't know where Dirk could get such an amazing set of armor. 
armor was especially expensive, even more so than weapons. So where did he get the money, and who crafted it for him? And when? Many questions that even his parents had were thought about. Nobody had seen Obsidius, and only Pandora knew about the blob's functions besides Dirk and perhaps the Vampire Queen. Cool armor. Viola muttered after Dirk seemed ready. Thanks. His monotone voice responded, making him seem even more robotic. Finally, once Viola equipped a long but sleek sword, they stood opposed to each other. They were silent for a moment, nobody indicating that the battle had started. But then, Viola stepped forward. She didn't suddenly break out into a dash, nor did she release an attack. She just walked forward, the tip of her sword weaving around to her side, as if she were playing with it. But Dirk immediately sensed her expertise. She seemed to be ready for anything he could throw at her. No matter what happened, she would close the distance between them. There was nowhere he could run. It amazed Dirk. By simply walking, Viola was cutting off avenues of escape and invoking feelings of helplessness. But unfortunately for her, Dirk could already see through it. His instincts were too sharp to fall into a trap like that. But this was a spar, not some battle to the death. So instead of attempting to break her down, he decided to match her. Dirk took a step forward, and from the stands, Cecilia smiled. He walked almost exactly like she did. He matched her cadence, her stature, and both seemed to be attempting to dominate the other with their unspoken presence. It made Viola smile as well. And then, they met in the middle. They stepped toward each other at the same time, and just as they were about to collide, their bodies twitched. Viola let off a simple slash. But shockingly, in response, Dirk stabbed forward instead of blocking. His speed was shocking enough. It was explosive, like his arm was a cannon. But it couldn't block her strike, and it was stupid to think he was trying to trade blows. But then, just as her blade was going to land, he flickered. Viola sensed spatial fluctuations, causing her mana vision to focus behind her where Dirk's figure appeared. But then, another figure appeared to her right. And just as she thought that was the true Dirk, another appeared to her left. For Dirk's that, for a split second, resided in four places at once, all of them stabbing toward her neck. Her body shifted, attempting to block the strike of the figure to her left. It was the last to appear, and she could tell that this was a deviated version of void walking. So she believed that the last figure was the end of the spatial channel. But just as she deviated from her initial strike forward, all the Dirks disappeared and the dirk in front of her, the one that had never moved, settled into place. His blade arrived before her neck, stopping and nicking her skin. And her strike was nowhere to be seen, her focus toward her left where there was no nothing. For a moment, everything froze. And then, Viola let out a nervous chuckle. Holy shit. I have no response to that. She turned her head back to her front. Dirk had never actually moved. He just overlapped his presence in four different places. It was something Dirk realized after studying his magic more. The spatial channel he created placed his body in multiple places at once. Dirk had been learning to extend the amount of steps he could take, allowing him to void walk further without brute forcing the spatial channel to extend into instability. But, just because he took four steps didn't mean he had to settle on the last one. He could settle on any of the steps he took because he was technically in all those places at once. It was an extremely deceptive tool, one that allowed him to defeat his sister in a single exchange. Of course, it may not be able to happen again, but since when did enemies meeting on a battlefield get to have second chances in a fight? She was as good as dead. Clap clap clap. There was a small cheer from the stands, Cecilia clapping with a wide smile. Good. Very good. Impressive. Everyone nodded as well. It was a fight that lasted no more than a few seconds and consisted of walking and a single sword strike from each party. But all of them were familiar enough with battle to recognize the skill displayed by both parties. Only Exos didn't have as much of a clue, but he still recognized that Dirk had defeated somebody more powerful than him with a single move. It was amazing. 
Viola sighed as Dirk lowered his sword. Then, his helmet disappeared, revealing a smile. Like that party trick? Ha! Good one. It seems your talent has gone beyond ours. You've got insane instincts. It's just a difference in attributes. That's no excuse, but then again, maybe talent is an excuse too. So I won't make any. But I do want to try again. Sure. Dirk didn't mind as they both went back to opposite ends of the arena. Neither had really moved around, and there was much deeper skill to be shown. There was no way either of them would want to end things there. And this time, Viola had enough of an impression to know that, not only could her little brother take care of himself, but she would actually need to be completely invested in the fight, otherwise she'd get outmaneuvered and defeated. This time, there would be no fancy tricks, and upon starting another bout, there weren't. Dirk generally refrained from using void walking, only activating it to shift out of sticky situations. Otherwise, he and Viola competed with their swords as the focus, their magic being supplemental. Viola used earth and air magic to move around with smooth yet lightning quick steps, her attacks chaining together with constant momentum and carrying great weight behind every swing. Dirk felt like his arm was colliding with a heavy metal pole every time their swords came together. He had to stress his own strength in order to not get thrown around. However, when it came to speed, he didn't lose out. For one, Dirk had literal lightning quick movements. The lightning mana in his body occasionally exploded with a bolt of electricity, causing his muscles to contract with extreme force and move before he even told his body to. It made his strikes fast and his reactions faster. While the burden on his body was great, because he had completed muscle destruction, he could go like this so long as had the energy. But, with their physical capabilities not playing a most decisive role on the outcome, the battle shifted according to their skill instead. Primarily, their sword skills. Dirk never learned anything about properly wielding a sword. He was never taught any techniques and never wanted to learn any for some mysterious reason, only figuring out how to do the basics. For everything else, he was blind, though he didn't really mind that. Dirk had his own style of fighting that translated into everything he did. His sword strikes were direct, taking the most optimal path for what he was trying to accomplish with every blow. They had very little finesse and there was zero technique to speak of. But he could chain together his attacks just as well, if not better than Viola. His inhuman combat senses had basically developed their own sword style, something only the most adept combatants in the stands could see, which was everyone aside from Exos. The battle continued for an entire 15 minutes, during which, nobody pulled their eyes away. Dirk had let Viola control the tempo, and gradually, she had become faster and more aggressive. They had spent a few minutes feeling each other out in consideration. They established their basic capabilities before getting more advanced. More magic, more strength, more technique, more speed. Now, fifteen minutes later, they moved across the arena as their swords send out rapid sounds of collision, several every second. And their figures were like two blurs, dashing across a dozen meters at a time. And from beneath his mask, Dirk smiled as he fought. He felt that Viola was a very suitable sparring partner, one who could keep up yet couldn't overwhelm him. Dirk felt like he was always surrounded with people who stood too far above him or too far below him. But Viola, despite being technically stronger, was a good match to his abilities. Of course, he was withholding a majority of what he could do. He was sure that, if it came down to it, he could kill Viola with certainty. But underneath that level of battle, they clashed on equal grounds. From what he could see on her face, she too was enjoying this battle. And because of that, neither of them felt like stopping. At some point, their battle had reached an hour in duration. When they reached this point, their battle shifted from simply fighting to learning. Each of their styles went through changes. Dirk, from seeing Viola's swordsmanship, began mimicking some of those techniques. He also got a feel for his Sword of Dissonance. He had been using it strictly as a basic weapon, but he now let loose some of its functions, learning how its power could be used. Viola was also learning to adapt to Dirk's very direct yet uncanny ability to deflect, counter, and nullify her attacks. 
she was learning what it meant to fight someone with atrocious combat senses, and though she couldn't simply modify her sword techniques like Dirk could, she could still reform her own decision making. She could mimic those combat senses to some extent, seeing the decisions he made and applying them to herself. Not only that, but when the Sword of Dissonance started to operate, she had to adjust for the difference in weapons. It forced her reactions to quicken, something she was allowed to do since Dirk didn't unleash its abilities in full force. All these things resulted in their battle becoming more than a spar. And when it reached this point, Riker only sighed. Well, there's no stopping them now. Here, why don't I take you all to a housing unit so you can get settled? Thank you, Sir Strider. That would be appreciated. Pandora smiled and rose from her seat, Exos and Nova following. Exos had started to get bored, his mind drifting to his enchanting. And Nova had seen enough to begin to understand Dirk's power. She also had a faint smile while looking at Viola. It seemed not every member of that family was a freak. Like that, everyone except for Cecilia and Ethan left. Put more earth mana into your foot. As she watched them fight, Cecilia suddenly spoke. Her tone was normal, as if she were talking to someone beside her. But eventually, she smiled as Viola did exactly what she told her. Her foot was loaded with more earth mana, stabilizing and linking it to the floor she used for propulsion. Soften your aura. Use those back muscles when swinging your sword like that. Don't extend your strike so much. No one to pull back. Focus on the tip of your aura, not its body. Cecilia occasionally threw out words, each of them being a critique of both Dirk and Viola. And both of her children heeded her advice, even though they seemed wholly engrossed in their battle. Cecilia had realized at some point that this battle had become a moment of inspiration for them, or at the very least, an inspiration for Viola. With Dirk's stimulation, she was flourishing and learning at a rapid pace. And Cecilia found this to be the perfect time to correct some flaws. And Viola's presence sharpened, almost as if melding with Dirk's own in an attempt to both adapt to yet mimic it. She was refining herself under his pressure. Turns out, like Dirk, Viola was a Rook-class warrior. After all, rising to Bishop-class was a massive mountain to climb. In that respect, Dirk and Viola were pretty equal. But, that aura of hers seemed to be pushing past some kind of barrier. Cecilia could see it, and Dirk could feel it. As she sharpened, so too did her sword and aura. And in her trance, the pressure she placed on Dirk increased by quite a bit. He found himself on the back foot. With every strike, he felt his palms threaten to rupture under the impact of her sword. Her speed shot up, forcing Dirk to stress his lightning technique and body to keep dodging. He was also forced to start reading her like he did in normal battles, controlling the pace that she kept trying to shatter with overwhelming force. As their battle approached five hours in duration, Viola was finally showing greater power than Dirk. She was performing according to her true stature, and Dirk was hard-pressed to maintain himself. But that pressure was good for him too. He needed to improve, so along with refining his own aura against hers, he worked on employing more magic, shifting between all his spells. Void walking became more frequent, forcing Viola to slow down and anticipate his movements yet not let Dirk use that against her. Her instincts screamed, but that was exactly what she needed. Dirk's magic seemed to operate from all angles. There was metal, darkness, and fire flowing through the arena, but at no point did it shatter Viola's momentum. She was only further stimulated, facing it all in her trance. At some point, the battle reached a climax. Cecilia and Ethan watched as all the elements besides water sparked and surged through the arena grounds, scarring the earth and stands. Both of them were laying out everything they had. The only thing that Dirk lacked was the intent to kill, but otherwise, he was using his fullest power against his sister who was now facing him as if trying to wipe him from this planet. Scars even appeared on his armor, faint marks caused by sword strikes Dirk didn't bother dodging as they wouldn't threaten him. And then, just as they passed the eight-hour mark, Dirk, who was about to slash out, suddenly jerked back and sent the sword strike away from his sister. 
a blade of aura flew past her body and into the air beside her before dissipating. He looked at his sister, who had suddenly stopped on her feet, her eyes half closed. That's when Cecilia suddenly appeared beside her, catching her body that gradually leaned and fell to the side. Looks like she passed out. She can't match her stamina. She looked toward her son, seeing Dirk breathing heavily. His armor retracted, and that's when Cecilia's eyes widened. Dirk's body was entirely drenched in sweat, his skin red as if boiling, with actual steam rising from his body. Are you okay? Yeah. Dirk responded, but his voice was absent. It seemed that, although he didn't fall into as deep of a trance as his sister, he had still been rather inspired. But he had also pushed himself to his absolute limits. Even now, Cecilia could see all the various types of mana pumping through his veins. Fire mana was heating his body, dark mana was distorting the space around him, and the earth mana was shifting the dirt under his feet as if to automatically accommodate his every step. Smiling, she placed her hand on Dirk's head. Go to sleep. I'll take care of you. Dirk was silent, but after a few seconds, he really did fall asleep on his feet. With a chuckle, Cecilia scooped up both her children, carrying them off to their house.